This is Audible. Audible Inc. presents Assault Troopers, written by Vaughn Hepner, narrated by Christian Rummel. Prologue. I remember the day it finally happened. The day an alien race made contact with humanity. The latest presidential campaign was already in full swing. Endless rivers of money flowed to advertisers and political slogans clogged the airwaves. As far as I can recall, no astronomer spotted the alien starship cruising through the solar system, passing Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and then parking in orbit around Earth. One minute there was nothing. The next, CNN, Fox News, every TV station on the planet blurted out the amazing story of a real-live UFO visitor. The vessel was mind-bogglingly big. One commentator said as huge as Rhode Island. It was as if someone had hollowed out one of the bigger asteroids and stuck engines in it. But this thing wasn't an asteroid. It was metal, a construct, black, oval, and with giant fins sticking out of it like an old 57 Chevy. The political ad stopped airing as the TV stations played the alien starship 24-7. I was stationed in Antarctica. My name was Creed, by the way. Just Creed. I didn't like my first name and had never used it. We sat glued before the TV, forgetting about the science experiments. According to what we watched, people by the thousands, millions maybe, aimed their backyard telescopes or binoculars at the vessel. And of course, the military used radar. For 37 hours, the starship waited up there as silent as the Sphinx, making the world increasingly nervous. Finally, the U.S. couldn't resist doing something to prod the aliens into talking. They pulled out a mothballed shuttle and launched it into orbit. Who should pilot it but Mad Jack Creed, my father? My mom had divorced him years ago, but we'd kept in touch. He was one of the few people to visit me during my stint in prison. Mad Jack spoke into the shuttle camera giving the world a running commentary as his craft approached the alien ship. It was amazing. I watched. The world watched. Maybe it would have been better if it had been a grainy image instead of pure HD. Mad Jack grinned out of the TV. He'd torn off the goofy astronaut's headgear and put on his old Air Force cap with its chipped silver rocket pin on the bill, and he sported four days' growth of beard. He'd flown F-18s in his day, a fighter jock with three confirmed kills. It was obvious he was enjoying the heck out of getting up in the air again. He shoved his face in the camera and told us the alien hovered 260 miles over Spain. The dimensions of the starship awed me as my dad approached it, like a flea nearing an elephant. My chest ached with pride for my old man. He had guts, and he played this cool and collected. I know they must have asked for volunteers, and he would have been the first in line. As Mad Jack talked, cameras showed the shuttle's bay doors opening and a space arm unfolding, lifting a giant communications device. Computers began aiming the dish at the starship. The aliens had been quiet, continuing their sphinx-like routine of inscrutability. Finally, however, they began to react. Look, my dad's co-pilot said. Something's happening. Focus camera five, Mad Jack said. I couldn't sit still as the others watched. At first, I'd crouched in front of the TV with my fists clenched. Now I strode back and forth behind the other sitting watchers, needing to move. None of my co-workers told me to sit down. They knew better. What is that? My dad's co-pilot asked. That registered with me. I stared at the screen. I imagine everyone in the world stared into their TV or smartphone feed. They all saw a slot open on the starship. It appears Mad Jack is making them react, the TV commentator said. Without warning, a beam fired out of the starship. A ray of incandescent light, looking more like a sci-fi movie than reality. My dad had time to shout a single, angry profanity. 
Our TV picture froze for a moment and showed him hunched over his panel, staring out of the shuttle window. He looked as if he wanted to launch missiles in retaliation. I saw him. I saw the fighter glaring out of his eyes. Then there was nothing but old-fashioned, blizzard-like static on the tube. The TV technicians worked fast. They switched to an open-mouthed commentator outside the Pentagon. The woman blinked several times in confusion until someone told her she was live. The aliens dusted the shuttle, I said. The others in our Antarctica shelter turned toward me. A cold, hard knot of fury erupted in my chest. The aliens had killed my dad. A fierce sense of loss exploded in my stomach. I swayed, staggered back, and sat hard on the floor. I stared, slack-jawed, seeing nothing in particular. Look, Rolo said. What are those? I remember focusing, turning to stare at the TV again. Openings appeared in the vast starship. Was the network using a satellite to image this? Big, ugly... Missiles, they must have been missiles, darted out of the ship. They moved like hungry sharks, showing long exhaust tails. The missiles dived into the Earth's atmosphere and headed in different directions. For different cities, it turned out. The next few minutes of TV showed a medley of shouting, panicked confusion. I witnessed Patriot missiles lofting trying to shoot down what we found out later were thermonuclear annihilators screaming toward U.S. targets. Another brief report told us that the Chinese had a laser defense system that no one had known about. None of it mattered. Earth tech wilted against the alien battleware. Beijing vanished in the biggest mushroom cloud the world had ever seen. Los Angeles disappeared. So did New York City, Rio de Janeiro... Johannesburg, Cairo, London, Berlin, Moscow, Bombay, and Homin Chin City. As if that wasn't enough, the aliens dusted the planet with a bioterminator. It was the last thing I witnessed on the TV. A big drone spraying black spores into the air. That proved the aliens must have known about humanity ahead of time in order to create a biological weapon to kill the survivors. Either that, or that's what they'd been perfecting for the last 37 hours. In the blink of an eye, Judgment Day came to us. It started with Mad Jack Creed and ended with over 99% of humanity dead and gone. The nuclear holocaust killed hundreds of millions. The bioterminator proved worse. Billions choked on black gunk bubbling in their throats. Most drowned to death in their own fluids. A few of the nukes and mutated spores missed succumbed to radiation poisoning or the horrifyingly new weather patterns. The aliens proved to be more like Darth Vader than E.T., and that might have been the end of humanity. What chance did the final 1% have? Actually, less than 1%. The survivors remained in places like Antarctica, where we were. I took my rifle out of my locker that day and never put it back. I yearned to kill aliens. Survivors were left on oil platforms in the Arctic Ocean. In submarines, on deep-sea transports, and in Siberia and other remote places. Out of billions, a few million shocked and scattered individuals waited for extinction. A high proportion of them were military or in high-risk occupations. That meant far more men than women survived. In the aftermath, although no one knew it yet, women became the most precious commodity left. If Homo sapiens were to escape the dodo bird's fate, the last females were going to have to bear plenty of healthy children. Otherwise, in one generation, there would be no human race. I'd like to say we rose up, the last humans, pitched in together and overcame every obstacle with our native pride, stubbornness, and cunning. No, it wasn't anything like that. It was grimmer, darker, and included low-down killing, the kind where we wrestled in the slime, gasping for breath, 
enduring agony and deep cuts. Our prize was the opportunity to stick a knife in our enemy's guts. Maybe that's too metaphorical. I don't know. The thing is, the aliens and their monstrous starship made a mistake. They should have finished their filthy deed, exterminating the last of us as if we were cockroaches. Instead, yeah, maybe it's time to tell this in a direct, linear fashion. Before I start, I should add that the last humans were the rough kind, the risk-takers, the lucky, the mean and the tough bastards who worked hard for a living. I was one of them, and I wasn't a wallflower nice guy. Not that I was bad. Misunderstood most of my life, yeah, but not evil. The best place to start would be that fateful day in Antarctica when I met the aliens face to face. I remember it all right. It happened like this. Chapter One Another purple-colored snowstorm howled outside our Antarctica shelter. Every once in a while, a high-pitched shriek added to the symphony of noise. The snow itself wasn't purple, but the clouds racing across the sky were. Purple, bloody red, and a stark orange I'd never seen before. We were in Victoria Land, near the Ross Ice Shelf. The McMurdo Military Base, a U.S. installation, had already gone under. Rollo took out the tractor yesterday to see why communications had stopped with him. We'd felt the shockwave, the earthquake, two days ago, or what we figured was a mother of a tremor. Rollo reported back that the shelf ice near McMurdo was gone. Some kind of tsunami must have cracked the surface and swallowed everything. That wave had probably slapped the land hard enough so we'd felt it here. The shock of losing McMurdo, the people and resources, further damaged what remained of our shattered morale. My comrades hunched around the radio. They were subdued, pale, and had wide, staring eyes. Communications tech Rice slowly twisted her dial, listening to static and waiting for some lone voice to talk to us. It was pathetic, and at the same time all too human with the digital numbers climbing higher and higher. Slower, one of the others whispered to Rice. You're going too fast. Shut up, she replied. I know what I'm doing. I sat well away from them. I didn't want to hear static or rewatch video footage of the starship, my dad's death, or the first nuclear explosions. Two days after the end of the world, I was near crazy with grief and impotent rage. It wasn't only Mad Jack who had died. My mother, cousins, my old grandfather, dead. My hometown, obliterated. My favorite football team, radioactive waste or a pile of black gunk. I tried to bottle the grief and keep down the howling beast inside of me because I didn't want to lash out at the others. They didn't deserve that. I hated everything about the World Destroyers. I wished I could invade their planet and drop antimatter bombs on them. I wanted to hurt the enemy. Maybe it was part of my makeup. I've always felt that if someone beat me to death, I was going to bite them back at the very least. I wanted to give them something to remember me by. A broken bone, a cut, or even a tooth mark on their ankle, if that's all I could manage. These aliens had beaten humanity to death, and none of us had been able to do a damn thing about it or to hurt them back in any way. I wish the Chinese lasers had worked at least a little. If we turned on our radiation detectors in the shelter, they still registered too high. We were all getting too many rads. Life anywhere on Earth had become just as bad as being sent to a Soviet-era nuclear submarine or living near Chernobyl. We were screwed. Humanity was screwed. Maybe the entire Earth. The penguins I'd seen yesterday had wobbled too much. They never were much good at walking. This bunch must have been migrating into the mountains. I'd seen thousands in a long stream, a carpet of them. And it seemed as if all those penguins were drunk. Hundreds just keeled over, 
kicking their webbed feet before spitting black gunk and dying. I buried them. I don't really know why I did. I guess it was better than doing nothing. Yeah, I shoveled frozen dirt over 400 penguins. I stopped counting at 399. I'd used my spade to hack at the icy ground until sweat poured from my skin. That black stuff they spit frightened me. That had been yesterday. Today, I sat on a stool away from the others. I had my rifle propped between my knees and an oily rag in my stained hands. The metal parts gleamed. This baby was ready to use and then some. I knew my dad would have approved. Did my eyes roll around in my head? The others had stopped looking at me, and they tiptoed when they moved near. I was security for the base. Well, me and Rollo. He was tall and bony, a real whiz with the computers and the video games. I'd boxed in the military, the U.S. Army, and I'd lugged the heavy machine gun around in the light infantry in Afghanistan. The name of Creed was one of the few things I inherited from Mad Jack, other than my temper and physique. The story of my life really started with my stepdad. He used to laugh when I did something stupid. It was harsh, jeering laughter. Before he learned better, he'd slap me around, too. Later, as I gained size, the laughter stopped, and he'd swear at me, adding a few punches. I only hit him once, and I'd felt guilty about it ever since. My mother used to send me to church, and I knew about honoring my father and mother. It was the third commandment. Still, my stepdad shouldn't have hit me. From his hospital room, my stepdad pressed charges. I'd been sixteen at the time. The judge had been a friend of his. The judge decided I was too big to go to a juvenile lockup. Under the provision of an obscure law, he sentenced me to prison as an adult. During my three years among the cons, I learned more about fighting than I ever wanted to know. It wasn't nice, fair fighting by rules, but bare knuckles. A shank of steel at times, and the heel of your shoe used to stomp and break bones. I'd almost been seventeen when the bars clanged behind me the first time. The age Robert E. Howard had made Conan the Barbarian in his literary entrance into civilization. I was too young for the pen, but I had size, attitude, and hard muscles. None of that mattered to most of those cons, who believed I was the virgin boy. The first time they tried, one of them brought two gangbanger buddies. They cornered me in the storage room next to the kitchen. I could see the lust in their eyes. It was a horrible thing when you were on the receiving end. I picked up a big jar of olives and smashed it against the nearest face. That was one of the most savage battles I ever fought. I have scars from it, and still dislike it if people close in around me. Those jailbirds never did me, though. Not those punks, and not anyone. The worst assault came three years later. It was a gang thing, payback for what I'd done earlier. Prison taught me about vengeance, because those I beat down never forgot and never forgave. This time I was armed with a shiv, a piece of metal with a cloth-wrapped handle. Mine was sharpened to a razor's edge. Long story short, I shanked two more wannabe rapists. One died, and one would limp for the rest of his life and would never be able to rape again. I found myself before an old white-haired judge with the thickest lenses I'd ever seen. It made his brown eyes behind them huge. I might have become a lifer that day because I defended my honor. The judge must have seen something salvageable in my belligerent stare but I don't know how it could have been possible. Maybe he knew how it was inside, and how I'd had no choice. At nineteen, I'd been lost to an inner rage. I recall standing in his courtroom with hunched shoulders, glowering up at him. He told me I had two choices. More prison, if I liked fighting so much, 
or the military. That old judge must be dead by now. Wish I could shake his hand and thank him for his kindness and for his mercy. I owed him big time. In any case, after army boot camp, I hoofed it up and down the mountains of Afghanistan, lugging a fifty caliber machine gun. They're heavy, and they get even heavier in high altitudes. There's not much to say about that time, except for that a lieutenant managed to get half our platoon killed in a firefight. I lost some close friends that day because of the man's carelessness. After the funeral, I spoke to the lieutenant concerning his stupidity. He was an arrogant prick and shouted at me. The man lacked all shame. His confusing orders had aided the Taliban. He could see that, right? No. He got red-faced, as I explained it to him, and he tried to drag out his service pistol. That was a hostile action. So I hit him and knocked out several teeth. For my justifiable self-defense, they tossed me out of the military. They must have partly agreed with my analysis about the lieutenant, because they could have stuck me in Leavenworth. Instead, I was only charged with insubordination and given a dishonorable discharge. Instead of going back to the States, I joined Black Sand, a military security contractor outfit. Supposedly, they didn't wage war, but supplied bodyguards for moneyed people in bad places. I did okay for a year. Then I got in an argument with my superior. Because of ongoing labor disputes, we set up a roadblock and checked papers for our employer, who owned the various company towns in his part of Java. It was an island down there in Southeast Asia, and the area was set amidst 200 square miles of coffee plantation. After three days and six hours of boring duty under some local banana trees, a little brown-skinned beauty pulled up in a jeep at our roadblock. She was a sight. Pretty little hat, red lipstick, and wearing nice white gloves. We'd seen her before. She was visiting her sister, one of the protesting labor leaders, and this girl liked to laugh. My superior, Mike Edwards, couldn't take his eyes off her and he'd been muttering for days what he'd like to do to her in our shed. His uncle ran Black Sand on Java, so he thought he could get away with anything. Mike was a big bastard, too, with a big gut, wide face, and mean black eyes. He constantly needed a shave, and there were always taco stains on his shirt. The man was a drunk, and mean drunk this time from too much scotch. Edwards told her to get out of the jeep. Rollo and I glanced at him. We knew her papers were in order. Edwards took a wide stance, gripping his gun belt with his thick fingers and dirty fingernails. He liked to feel important, and he shouted at her to hurry it up. She was classy, opened the door slowly and put high-heeled shoes onto the dirt. She had great legs and a short skirt, showing that her ass was as wonderful as the rest of her. Edwards licked his lips, and those piggy eyes shone with lust. I'd seen that look in prison, before I bashed faces and broke teeth with my olive jar. Is there a problem? she asked. Not yet, Edwards slurred. One of his paws descended onto her wrist, circling it like a fleshy manacle. She gave a little gasp of surprise. Edwards dragged her and when she tried to dig in her heels, he yanked, making her stumble after him. I'd heard stories about Edwards. He liked to rip off women's clothes, make them scream, and press down on them afterward as he indulged himself. In truth, the man was a pig. A big one. A rutting boar of a rapist. Edwards, I said. Bugger off, he told me. I'm busy for a while. What can you do? Rollo whispered to me. His uncle runs the place. If we lift a finger, we'll be in trouble. The little woman with the white gloves peered over her shoulder and gave me a pleading look. Edwards, I said again. He swiveled that wide face of his, stared at me, and spat in my direction. If you're smart, 
He roared with pain because I had stepped up as he spoke to me. I'd grabbed his thumb, the one on the girl's wrist, and twisted hard. That's what made him yell. Then I grinned in his face, twisting harder until he released her delicate wrist. Then my right foot happened to move behind his left heel, and the wallowing pig tumbled backward onto the dirt. Run, I told the woman. Vamoose. She backed away with terror in her eyes, staring at me and then at Edwards. He bellowed from on the ground and unsnapped his holster. I took two steps and kicked. The revolver he drew out of the holster spun into the jungle, the heavy thing slapping banana leaves before thudding somewhere out of sight. Go, I told her, pointing at her car. She hurried to it, slammed the door after getting in, looked once more at me and peeled out as Rollo held up the crossbar. Edwards was a tough guy, and he was used to getting his way, especially in these things. He rose like a ponderous elephant and shook his hurt hand. When he was done with that, he squinted at me, charged, and took his first swing. Rollo told me later that I was grinning crazy-like as Edwards' fists hammered against my ribs. I don't know about that. I let Edwards take several swings, though, before I beat him into unconsciousness. Soon thereafter, I found myself reassigned to Antarctica with these eggheads. Rollo joined me because he hadn't helped Edwards defend himself. Naturally, the uncle hadn't believed our side of the story. Or maybe he had, but didn't care. And that was the fact of my life. The powers that be sticking it to me because of greedy self-interest. It seems like it should have gotten easier, putting up with these injustices. But it never did. In any case, now the wind howled outside in Victoria Land, Antarctica, beating against our building. Rice hunched over the radio set spinning her dial with her glossy red fingernails with the little sparkly swirls. Others re-watched Starship video as if it was their favorite porn, seemingly unable to get enough footage of the destruction. I sat on my chair in a black funk, wishing there was an alien conqueror for me to kill. I debated praying for the first time in years, asking God to send me an alien. The main door swung open then. It felt weird and surreal. Had God heard my thoughts? The idea bemused me. Snow swirled through the open door. It blew between Rollo's long legs as he came in. Nope. No alien. I was disappointed. High in the sky, purple clouds raced like NASCAR madmen shifting into nth gear. Rollo stepped in, and his goggle-protected eyes locked onto me. What? I asked. He opened his mouth, but couldn't seem to speak. I saw confusion in his eyes, like an elk in the headlights. I stood up as my neck tingled. Without thinking, I chambered around. I held my rifle, a good old M14. There were extra magazines and two grenades in my parka pockets. His lips moved, and Rollo said, Aliens. I was already moving toward him. Maybe I sensed what he wanted to say. The others by the radio half-turned, staring at Rollo. I clutched his right triceps and let my fingers dig in painfully. That cleared his eyes. He raised his left arm, pointing up into the swirling sky. Aliens are coming! What are we going to do? With a snarl, I jerked Rollo out of the way and charged outside with my rifle. My disappointment vanished, and my mind became clear. It was payback time. Chapter Two As the wind hit me, I remembered my goggles hanging around my neck. The snowstorm raged, with stinging flakes biting my cheeks. I finally fit the goggles over my eyes, doing it one-handed because I still clutched the M14. Once the lenses were in place, I tilted my head upward into the storm. 
I expected to have to search for the alien ship, a flickering dot moving up, down, and all around. No need. This thing was the size of a jumbo jet minus the wings. It had a box shape, with the front slanted back, no doubt to lessen friction. The giant lander headed toward our shelters. We had three buildings and two high-tech tents. I'll make that one tent now. The new, crazy, messed-up wind had torn down the other one. Just like Rollo, I stood open-mouthed. Freezing flakes of snow landed on my tongue, a few hitting the back of my throat. This was a wild storm. With a click, I snapped my teeth together. Start thinking things through, though, because you're not going to get a second chance. Right. I needed to think. To analyze. But before I could do that, I had to observe. The alien lander moved smoothly. It appeared that the wind didn't buffet it hard enough to sway it from its flight path. Did the extraterrestrials possess anti-gravity? I'd read plenty of science fiction and played sci-fi video games with Rollo. I knew a few things, or thought I did. No, I didn't think they had anti-gravity. I spotted thrusters in back, and jets of flame, like from an F-16 using afterburners. I heard a thunderous roar, too. It was louder than a jumbo jet. I noticed as well that it did have stubby wings, small things. Nubs, really, which seemed to wobble the slightest bit. It told me the howling wind did buffet the craft. Somehow, that did it for me, and helped me regain my mental balance. These weren't magical creatures. Arthur C. Clarke had said something about super-high-tech appearing as magic to less developed beings. The lander now didn't seem magical to me, but understandable. Another group of thrusters appeared as the lander changed the manner and direction of its descent. The new thrusters sprouted from the bottom of the craft. They roared with flames as the lander came straight down. Swirling flakes melted in the stab of afterburners, and the thunder grew ponderous. I dropped my M-14 onto the snow and clapped gloved hands over my hood-protected ears. The noise was incredible, with the rumbling boom shaking through my body. Despite that, I watched, marveling at the lander. This thing was from another star system. Who knew how many light years away? In it were alien beings. Aliens who had annihilated most of Earth, including my dad. I ground my teeth together. This was my chance to hurt them for hurting us. Would it be a useless gesture on my part? I didn't know. Everyone was wired differently. I was a fighter by nature, a counterpuncher, and I believed it was an ominous sign that they were coming down here. Why well, send a lander near one of the few sets of survivors? It couldn't be for any reasons of kindness, but it must be due to their vicious alien psychology. Yeah, okay. I was ready to duke it out, to bite them on the ankle if I could. After days of wishing for something like this, I was too angry to run away. As it neared, the lander began to look bigger than a jumbo jet. This thing had to be the size of a football stadium, making it gargantuan. That troubled me. What did they use for fuel? I understood some of the alien tech, but we were still the aborigines, the Native Americans or the Indians if you're old school. I'd read a lot of history mostly in prison, to help me pass the time. When the Europeans went exploring throughout the world, it never went well with the aborigines. If the primitives were too few or too far down the scale of technology, they ended up being annihilated or assimilated. As far as Earth went, it appeared to me that we were like Australia in the 1700s when the British showed up with guns and sailing ships, high-tech for the time. That meant picking off the first alien, shooting him in the head, would achieve little. It would be like the Indians killing Christopher Columbus's rowboat landing crew. It still would have left the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria offshore. Could I hurt these aliens in a more grievous manner? 
I gazed past the lander, past the purple clouds with their red swirls spinning like whirlwinds, and tried to pierce the intervening mists into orbit. Did that mother of a spaceship still sit up there? If so, that's what I needed to shoot down. I snarled because I'd forgotten how to laugh. I felt so helpless. I almost picked up the M14 to empty the magazine against the lander's hull. Why didn't the alien craft launch a missile at us? Were the aliens coming down to hunt the last animals like the Predators had in those old movies? Was I just a big game animal to them? I decided to wait and find out. I could always fire my rifle later. Yeah, what good would that do? I might as well have pissed at the alien craft for all the harm I could do to them. My anger was hard and righteous, but fear kept trickling out of my gut, telling me to run and hide. Sometimes a mouse could survive where a lion died. Rollo stepped up beside me. I glanced at him. He looked over at me with his hands pressed against his ears. I recognized the look. It was the same as when Edwards had dragged the girl toward the shed. What can we do? The answer was not a damn thing. We were ants, fleas. It might have been better if we could have been bacteria or viruses. Wasn't that how H.G. Wells said Earthlings defeated the Martians in War of the Worlds? I watched the lander. What if I could carry a nuclear device inside it, like a suicide bomber? That would destroy it. Yeah, it wasn't indestructible. It wasn't a chariot of the gods. The beings inside were mortal. Otherwise they wouldn't need a spaceship, right? I opened my mouth to help lessen the pressure against my ears. The flames from the thrusters licked out a hundred feet and melted snow on the ground. The lander, the stadium-sized vehicle, blew ice and frozen dirt. Giant struts lowered into place from the bottom of the craft, with huge sleds or skis on the ends. The flames of the thrusters weakened. The noise became bearable, a piercing whine, and the monstrous shuttle thudded onto the earth, causing the ground where I stood to tremble against the soles of my boots. At that point, the fire in the rockets disappeared, and so did the thunderous sounds. Tentatively, I lowered my hands, and Rollo lowered his. I bent to scoop up my rifle. Rollo grabbed my shoulder. Do you think that's wise? Bent over like that, I pondered his question. I could go open-handed to the aliens who had murdered the Earth. I could show them what peaceful, lovable creatures we Earthlings were so they'd spare the last of us. Or I could carry a gun. I could go armed and fight back if the aliens decided they wanted the last Earthers as zoo specimens. They might kill me as too dangerous, but that would be better than becoming their cosmic play toy. I picked up the M14 and temporized because of the trickles of doubt radiating from my gut. I slung the carrying strap over my shoulder. Are you coming? I asked. The lander was about a half mile away. Rollo hesitated. Would you like to huddle in the shelter with them? I asked, jerking a thumb at Rice. The radio operator stuck her head out of the door with several others standing in the shadows behind her, watching. Do you think it's safe? Rollo asked. No, but who cares? He managed a sickly grin, and he patted his side, telling me he was strapping a pistol. Both of us gulped air, and the two of us marched toward the lander. I felt as if I walked to my gallows, a mouse marching to face a grinning hawk. About halfway there, the thing began unfolding a ramp from its side. They were coming outside. Would they be like the grotesque creatures from the movie Alien? Or maybe like Zergs from Starcraft? Would they be big, little, fast, slow, what? We reached the lander as the end of the ramp clanged against rocky ground. The entrance up at the top of the ramp opened, 
but it remained gray, as if covered somehow. The magnitude of the entrance bothered me. Were these things the size of elephants? Maybe thirty seconds later, a tracked vehicle pushed through the wall, or membrane of the opening. The substance seemed to cling to the tank, like a soap bubble to a finger pushed through it. Why bother with such a membrane? Do you see that? Rollo asked me. The tank or the membrane? I asked. Membrane, he said, as if tasting the word. Yeah, that sounds right. They must use it to keep our atmosphere from rushing into their ship. I raised my eyebrows. Rollo was a bright, geeky guy. Yeah, his idea made sense. The tracked vehicle was the size of an M1 tank, and it began to clatter down the ramp. By my reckoning, it weighed seventy or eighty tons, but it was built along the lines from an Abrams. The alien tank was longer and lower to the ground, and it had a bubble canopy in the middle. A heavy machine-gun-sized turret poked out of the bubble, but I couldn't spy an orifice at the end of the barrel. The U.S. had fired depleted uranium shells from their tanks. The United States was gone. History now. Their tanks had used such shells. I didn't think that little turret fired solid projectiles, though. Likely it projected some kind of beam. It squeals just like our tanks, Rollo observed. He meant the treads. They clanked, squealed, and rattled as the vehicle climbed down the ramp. The treads needed oiling, servicing which made the alien seem a little less frightening. They had problems just like us. Well, maybe not extinction problems, but you know what I mean. The vehicle reached the snowy ground and turned sharply toward us. The turret lowered until it aimed at our chests. I don't like this, Rollo whispered. I shrugged because I didn't know what to say. The fear in my stomach had grown enough to dampen my former rage. Gripping the rifle strap with one hand, I put the other on my hip and stared at the turret. My feet itched with the desire to run away. My mind told me that was useless. If I ran, the turret could easily track and fry me. No, I'd come this far. Now I'd stick it out in a game of chicken which I was going to lose in less than thirty seconds. The thought of my coming death revived the anger. I forced myself to study the alien tank, searching for a hatch to force. If I could, I'd rip out all my fingernails trying to pry open a hatch so I could fire one bullet after another into the alien crew. All the while, the tank trundled closer, the heads churning over snow and spitting a muddy-colored spume from the sides. Creed, Rollo said. We gotta move. So move, I said, staring at the tank heading straight for me, hating it the closer it neared. What's standing here gonna prove? He asked. Not a damn thing, I said, with my gaze riveted onto the tank. I was a mouse daring a hawk, and I was about to become squished human. Despite my best efforts to observe, I didn't see a hatch, a way into the tank. I revised my plan, then, because it seemed insane to let myself get rolled over. Bite, scratch, do something to hurt them. The open entrance up there on the lander gave me an idea. When I give the word, I said out of the corner of my mouth, Go left. I'll go right. Yeah. Rollo said, in a skeptical tone. And then what? Then we circle the tank and sprint for the ramp. What? Why do that? For the best of reasons, I said. We rush up the ramp, storm inside the lander, and kill everyone on board. Then we have ourselves an alien space vehicle. Rollo looked at me. He didn't look scared, but confused. It was enough to cause me to glance at him. Are you crazy? he asked, in a voice telling me it was a genuine question. 
Before I could answer, the alien tank squealed to a halt thirty feet from us. At the same moment, the end of the turret glowed with a pink color. Before we could move, a ray beamed in a wide swath, including Rollo and me in its path. I'd played chicken with the aliens and obviously lost. I was sure this is exactly how they'd treated my father. The beam wasn't hot, but it was bright like the sun and seemed to encompass my mind and thoughts. My first instinct, after finding myself alive and on my feet, was to drop to my belly and slither away, but I hesitated. The pink light continued to flood my eyesight, and I found myself blinking rapidly. What in the... in the... It felt as if the beam flipped a dozen switches in my mind, and I became dull-witted as my anger drained away. There was a final moment of panic, and then the feeling evaporated. This entire episode began to feel like a dream. Alien landers, tanks, beams. I grinned. Maybe the aliens would come out and I'd get to meet them. The idea filled me with something approaching giddy excitement. The beam stopped, and I massaged my forehead, even rubbing my eyes. A strange languor gripped me. I felt torpid and more than a little sleepy. Something in the alien tank uncompressed and a blast of noise like a trucker's air brakes. It should have frightened me, or made me flinch, at least. I felt my lips stretching into a smile. I was going to meet creatures from another planet. This was exciting. Lines appeared on the glaciers of the tank. Steam rose from inside as the front part of the vehicle opened like a jackknife, the slab of armor becoming a mini ramp from the tank. Behind it was a blank wall, or what appeared to be another membrane. Something oozed out of the membrane until a humanoid in battle armor, or perhaps a spacesuit, stood at the top of the tank ramp. The being was humanoid in that it possessed two arms and two legs. It also had a long tail. It wasn't a monkey-like tail, but something an upright, walking alligator might have. Sorry, and Rollo said in a lazy voice. Huh? I asked, feeling unreal staring at an alien from a distant star system. It's a Saurian, Rollo muttered. Oh, I saw what he meant. The alien had a bubble-like helmet. The creature was a walking lizard, or looked like one, a giant gecko from those insurance commercials. That widened my smile, and for a second I wondered if this Saurian would speak in a British accent. The Saurian had a different gait than we did, walking in a springier manner, and it was smaller, maybe four and a half feet tall. It stalked down the tank ramp, its lizard-like eyes regarding us. Moisture appeared on the inside of its helmet. The thing opened its mouth and a forked tongue flickered. How oh, very interesting. The creature must have pressed a switch somewhere on its suit. Air seemed to blow inside the bubble helmet and the moisture on the inside glass, or whatever the substance was, vanished particle by particle. Perhaps it tasted our air. Rollo cleared his throat, and I had the impression he planned to say something to the Saurian. I'm not exactly sure, but an inner caution, perhaps, dampened by a modicum of my joy. Something seemed different. I'd watched the lander come down, and... and... Wait, I told Rollo. We should try to communicate with him, Rollo said. This is the chance of a lifetime. Yeah, I said, looking at Rollo. He smiled, and his eyes shined with excitement. Did I look like that, too? The pink light? We should greet him and let him know we're safe, Rollo said. Greet him, I thought. Hadn't my dad greeted the aliens earlier? My memories were fuzzy. Yeah, 
I think my dad had gone up in a shuttle, and the memory slammed against me. The aliens had shot a beam of light at my dad, killing him. So why would I grin at this lizard now as if he was a friend? A pink light. The Saurians had just beamed a pink light into our eyes. Had the light played havoc with our minds? Wheels turned in my sluggish, dreamlike thoughts. These aliens were screwing with our minds just as they had messed up our world. No, I wasn't going to play along. Whatever the aliens had just fired at us, my inner rage burned through like a bright welding arc. Rollo must have seen something different on my face. He recoiled from my glare and took a step back. I turned and glared up at the alien, at this saurian bastard with his pink, mind-altering ray. Its eyes flickered back and forth between Rollo and me. It raised a hand, paw, talon, whatever the thing possessed. Something radio-like crackled on its suit. Then it moved its lips. A second later, a synthetic voice issued from a suit speaker. That told me this thing must have a device to take its words and translate them into our language. Sure, its pink beams could alter our moods or thoughts. Clearly, it knew something about human psychology. But the fact that it had to speak meant it could not communicate directly to our minds. The suit speaker must be hooked up to a translator. Both items proved the aliens had studied Earth in the past. Words boomed from it, but whatever it said sounded Russian to me. Why don't you try English, I said. The Saurian watched me closely, and I had the impression it listened to my words in its alien language. The lizard twisted a dial on its suit. Its gloved hand or talon consisted of three claws and what would have to pass for an opposable thumb. The individual claw or finger appeared to have one more joint than our fingers did. The Saurian spoke again. The outer speaker crackled, and it said in English, do you understand me? Yeah, I said. What do you want? Creed, Rollo warned from behind. You gotta take it easy. They're peaceful. A pressure built up in my chest. I yearned to unlimber my rifle and blow away this world destroyer. It had been a fool to climb out of its tank, trusting in its mind-altering beam. Had they tested it on other humans? Hadn't anyone broken through the beam's quick conditioning before? My indicators show you are radiating emotions, the Saurian told me. How about that, I said. This is good, the Saurian said. Good. The arrogance tripped a wire in me. I slid the strap from my shoulder and gripped the M-14 two-handed, pointing the barrel at Mr. Lizard. Creed, don't! Rollo pleaded. They're here to help us! You are an aggressive beast, the Saurian told me. This is excellent. The Jelk will be pleased. I scowled. Who you calling a beast? The Saurian waited before speaking again. Beast, animal, creature, monster. Does the translator not render my meaning into a word you can understand? You think we're monsters? I asked, outraged. My stepdad had called me an animal before. He'd been slapping me as he said it. Some of the guards at prison had told me I was nothing more than a caged beast. One guard in particular who liked nudging convicts with the tip of his baton had told me society should throw away the key and leave us animals to rot in here. I hated cages, confinement, and being treated like scum. I'd had my fill of it. My chest constricted now, and my anger tightened into a coil. The alien waited, apparently listening to my words and then thinking about them. Not monsters, it said. But beasts, animals, yes, 
You are an aggressive beast with a rudimentary language. Training will render you useful to the Jelk. The words struck like slaps to the face. I figured I was a wolf to capture and train. What else could such words mean? No, the aliens wouldn't call me like a wolf, a wild mustang, or a convict. In its arrogance, the alien before me had made a fatal mistake. The tightened coil in my chest snapped, and rage washed through me. He's not going to cage me. He almost had me with his pink ray. I shouted profanities at him. I decided to think of the Saurian as male. Not only had the aliens destroyed the Earth, but this one insulted the first human it met and threatened me with capture and beast training. The Saurian recoiled as if I'd struck him. How did his device translate my curses? His demeanor changed. It was obvious. One of his limbs, arms, dropped toward what looked like a gun attached to his spacesuit. It was the last straw. I tucked the M14 stock against my shoulder, aimed and pulled the trigger three times. The first bullet starred the glass of his helmet and knocked him back. The second round made crackling lines so I couldn't see his scaly features as well as before, and the second impact also made him stagger more. The last bullet did the trick, smashing his low forehead and splattering blood and bits of bone inside the glass. Creed, you're insane! Rollo shouted. The alien slid down as if his bones simply dissolved. He crumpled, with his body and suit tumbling down the small ramp and landing on earth soil. I was in overdrive, blood mad at these murderers. But I also kept my wits, my rationality. I had to finish what I'd started and take out the tank crew. I bolted over the alien and charged up the ramp. The end of the turret glowed pink once more. Maybe the crew planned to give me another dose of its mind-stealing ray. The membrane looked solid ahead of me, but I'd seen the alien move out of it. The tank had moved through a membrane earlier, before it had come down the lander's ramp. I lowered my shoulder and met resistance. Then I powered through the substance. Heat slammed against my face, and the air in here tasted foul and was sticky making my eyes water. Three Saurians sat at various stations. One of them was higher up in the bubble dome. No doubt he was the gunner. They whipped around on their stools to stare at me. One hissed angrily like a snake. Another flicked its tongue at me. Each blasting retort of my M14 was deafening in the confines of the alien tank. The nearest Saurian pitched backward its chest erupting with blood. Methodically, I shot the bastards, careful to use each bullet where I thought it would do the most damage. I had three magazines with me and a lander full of these creatures to kill. It took four bullets to take out these three, meaning I still had some ammo left in the original magazine. As the last shot echoed in my ears, I found myself panting. The stench of their blood clung inside my nostrils. It was a nasty odor. The aliens stank, and they flopped on the floor, acting too much like shot snakes for my peace of mind. Moving as if on autopilot, I shoved a hand into a parka pocket, reassured that I had put two grenades there earlier. These would help in the coming assault. Hisses from several screens and an alarm rang inside the tank. The screen showed alien creatures, likely those remaining in the lander. There were strange symbols or words written on various bulkheads around me. While charging within, I'd had some idea of figuring out how to use the alien tank against the lander. As I looked around, I realized that wasn't going to happen fast enough. It would take too long to figure out their controls. Besides, this seemed like a human netting tank, an alien version of a dog-catching vehicle. They thought of us as beasts or animals. It was better to use what I knew right away, my M14, than to waste time. The initiative in battle counted for a lot. It might be the only thing I had going for me. I turned, readied myself, and burst through the membrane and back into the Antarctica cold. 
Rollo stood at the foot of the tank ramp, with his forty-five browning in his hand. That was a good sign. He looked confused, though. What happened in there? he asked. You didn't hear anything? I asked. Soft pops, he said. I killed the alien butchers. Why did you do that? he asked. They beamed you with a mind-altering ray, I said. They screwed with your thoughts. They're evil, Rollo. They destroyed our world. Don't you remember watching them kill my dad, Mad Jack Creed? Oh, he said. You're right. We gotta fight back, I said. We gotta take over their lander. I motioned with my hand at the stadium-sized ship. That's crazy, Rollo said. I know it, I said. But now's our only chance. Are you with me? He stared into my eyes, glanced at the dead Saurian, keeping his gaze there for two seconds, and then stared up into my eyes again. He nodded. Rollo was a good man. I took a breath of pure, clean earth air. It felt cold in my mouth, like the best spearmint. I'd overcome their mind ray and killed some of the world slayers. Now it was time to take out more and capture a lander if I could. Chapter 3 I led the way, with the sound of snow crunching under my boots. We had to move fast and keep attacking in order to keep the aliens off balance. They must have figured we Earthers were faint-hearted creatures, ready to wilt for the first master race aliens to come along. They were learning differently now. Why did the Saurian come outside its tank? Rollo asked. What? I said. I don't know, to capture us, I guess. It called us beasts. And that was reason enough to kill him? Rollo asked. Hey, I said. The alien beamed our minds, right? And then he went for his weapon. Besides, I don't need any more reason than this. His kind nuked our world. They declared war on us, not the other way around. After that, he wants to talk to us while we're smiling idiots? No, I don't think so. I stepped onto the larger lander ramp and saw a space-suited Saurian appear up top. The lizard had a long gizmo in its hands or talons. The device looked like a long-barreled rifle. Charging up the ramp, I fired from the hip. That didn't make for the most accurate shooting. My first bullet missed and wanged off the hull of the lander, creating a spark. The Saurian ducked. Then it seemed to think again, gained resolve, and stepped forward, aiming its gizmo down at me as if it was a long Kentucky flintlock. My second bullet caught a hand. The Saurian opened its mouth and let out a shrill hiss. It dropped the alien rifle. This time it took two bullets to do the trick, cracking the bubble helmet and pumping lead into the face. I hadn't stopped panting from my fight aboard the tank. Instead of weird alien stenches and atmosphere, now I was tired from sprinting up the long ramp. The Antarctica cold freeze-burned my throat as if I'd swallowed an ice cream cone. I could hear Rollo behind me gasping for air. The top of the ramp proved flat and the membrane opening into the lander meant I couldn't see what was on the other side. Take his weapon, I said, using the M14's barrel to point at the alien gizmo. I've been thinking, Rollo told me. We might have made a mistake. Here on the ramp, we were at least fifty feet high. The top of the lander might be another one hundred and fifty feet above us. The thing was massive. These lizards nuked our world, I shouted. They sprayed something afterward that makes penguins spit black gunk. Then they tried to capture us. This is our one chance. We have to grab it and do the best we can. But capture a whole ship? Rollo asked. Once it's ours, we fly to an army base and pick up more soldiers. Then we head into space and see if we can capture the big daddy spaceship. That's just crazy, Rollo said. There's no way we can pull that off. You got a better idea? I asked. Or do you want to be one of the trained beasts? 
He blinked at me several times, apparently trying to process the ideas. Maybe the pink ray still messed with his thinking. Take the alien rifle, I said. Start figuring out how it works. You're the tech guy, the computer geek, so you should be able to do that. Rollo blinked one more time. Then he holstered the forty-five, nodded stubbornly, to himself, I think, and picked up the long gizmo. I dragged my upper teeth across my lip, trying to psych myself up to charge inside and wreck what mayhem I could. Would the aliens use poison gas on us inside their vessel? Did their atmosphere hold treacherous elements that would render us unconscious in several minutes? I had no clever ideas now. No big plans other than shooting aliens until I ran out of bullets. Then I'd use my bowie knife and find out how strong these lizards were. Here we go, I said. Expecting the worst, I ran at the membrane and dove. I hit the barrier low and burst into a large gym-sized chamber. It had three more alien tanks waiting. Crews climbed into them through the front. I didn't have time to see more of the chamber, although five Saurians with long rifles marched toward the outer entrance. They wore spacesuits, but without helmets. At the sight of me, they unlimbered their weapons and fired a volley. Every one of the lizards aimed too high. It was the reason I'd instinctively dived through and come in low. The long rifles shot finger-sized projectiles that sizzled through the air. Each alien bullet or grenade hit the membrane behind me, plowing through but not before shorting the barrier, destroying it in some fashion. The howling Antarctica wind swirled into the lander. None of the firing Saurians wore helmets. Some of the tank crews stared in what I'd swear was horror at the lost membrane. Was Earth air bad for them, as Rollo had suggested earlier? Rollo crawled through the burst opening, swinging his alien rifle wildly. Here, I said. I'd crawled to a box of some kind for cover. Rollo saw me, and he aimed the long gizmo, pressing a button. The alien rifle discharged another of those finger-sized grenades that sizzled as it flew. It struck near an open tank and detonated. Sizzling lines of electricity, or something like electricity, felled the nearest lizards. A savage sound of laughter tore out of my throat. How oh, I'd wished for a moment like this during the last several days. I began aiming carefully, shooting aliens. Some scrambled to get away from me and out of this chamber of death. Others rushed into their tanks. One of the tank ramps began to close into the front glacis. I stood up, took out a hand grenade, yanked the pin. It tinkled against the alien floor and hurled the explosive like a fastball. The grenade flew into the vehicle. I heard it explode as the ramp eased into the glacis. We're doing it! I shouted. I scooped up my M14, tore out the spent magazine, and slapped in another. Some of the lizards had sprinted for an opening deeper in the chamber. I headed that way. Come on, Rollo! I shouted. We raced through the gym-sized compartment. None of the canopies on the alien tanks had begun moving yet. No engines revved. Nor did turret guns beam their mind-screwing rays. We'd caught them by surprise. A fierce elation filled me. It was impossible to conquer the lander. Or it should have been impossible. But why not try? Cortez had conquered Aztec Mexico against impossible odds. If nothing else, I could win this lander. Figure out the controls and ram the alien starship. We'd make them feel some pain for trying to annihilate humanity. I found out that a sprinting human was faster than a Saurian in a suit. None of the five who had fired at us made it out of the chamber. The last one twitched and flopped in death near the rear exit, with the back of his lizard head a gory ruin. This one possessed a similar hand weapon on its belt as the first Saurian I'd shot outside. I pried off the weapon. It was similar to a flare gun. I'd need something once I ran out of bullets, so I unzipped my parka and tucked the alien gun against my belt. Despite the ruptured outer membrane and storming weather, it stayed hot in here. Scan left. I'll look right, I said, meaning once we forced our way through the next membrane. 
Go, Rollo said. He understood my meaning. We pushed through the membrane and found ourselves in a large corridor going both right and left. There were no saurians in sight, but a blast of heat and alien stench staggered each of us. The walls weren't smooth steel, but had fuzzy growths on them, like alien moss. The more I learn about saurians, the more I hate them, I said. What do we do now? Rollo asked. That was a good question. We had to keep attacking. That was the answer. Follow me, I said. I strode right, hurrying along the corridor. Some of the aliens made it into the tanks back in the last chamber, Rollo said, running after me. I know. We have to find the ship's control room fast. You can't be serious. Did you see the size of the ship? Finding the control room could take hours. We killed some of them, Rollo. They're going to want vengeance against us. Hard vengeance. The only thing left for you and me is to take down as many of these world destroyers as we can. We're walking dead men. The sooner you believe that, the better off you'll be. He grew quiet, and a change came over his face. A grim seriousness. You're right. They destroyed twenty cities in atomic fireballs and dusted us with their bioweapon. I wonder why they beamed us, though and then sent out a Saurian to talk to us. The answer came a minute later. Loud alarms or klaxons sounded. It made the hair stir on my neck. We turned right at an intersection and found another gym-sized chamber. This opening lacked a membrane. Rows of glass cylinders filled a quarter of the area in back. There were also two bulldozer-sized vehicles. Instead of a blade, each had a backhoe-like crane. And instead of a bucket, the ends possessed a clamp or a lobster-like claw. Each gripped an upright cylinder. Creed, Rollo said. Do you see what's inside those? My mind had focused on the vehicles and the room as I searched for saurians. Now I glanced at the nearest cylinder. My breath caught in my throat a sick feeling welled out from my stomach. A naked man stood in the nearest cylinder. He had his palms pressed against the glass and smacked against it several times. I noticed his face. He had his mouth open, and it looked as if he was shouting. The thick glass deadened his voice so I couldn't hear what the man was saying. Seeing this, the Saurians had already been elsewhere on the planet, using their pink rays on others. If I hadn't overcome the peaceful feeling earlier and killed the lizard on the tank ramp, I'd likely be in a glass tube right now. Both Rollo and I would be moths in a jar. I raised my rifle, aiming at the lower part of the cylinder. I was going to shoot the man out of there. Creed! Rollo shouted in warning. They're behind us! I spun around and saw them. Three ugly saurians in some sort of battle armor. These three didn't wear bubble helmets, but metal things with dark visors. I'd watched enough sci-fi movies to recognize combat suits. These three looked like tiny versions of mech warriors. The sight of the naked man in the cylinder filled me with loathing. I thought of Nazi experiments and what these aliens were going to do to us now. To them, we were beasts, just big game animals to hunt and mount back at home. I was going to teach them differently. I sprinted for the nearest backhoe-like vehicle. Rollo, I noticed, had already ducked out of sight behind one. He'd been closer to them. The three Saurians acted more aggressively than the lizards in the first chamber. These seemed more like soldiers. One of them aimed a heavy pistol, more like a flare gun, and fired a slow-moving projectile. I dove and rolled, trying to get away. The projectile turned out to be an electrical shock grenade, which hit the floor nearby, and I heard a sharp sizzling sound. Something like a pumped taser struck my left hip, jolting me. Then I rolled behind a Saurian vehicle and out of the grenade's radiating range. I slithered across the floor. My left leg was numb from the electrical impulse, and it didn't respond as well now. 
the three lizard mechs clanked toward me, sounding like something from an Iron Man movie. I strove to get up, to see what was happening. I couldn't let the lizards beat us now. They would surely torture us, or do other unspeakable things to Rollo and me for killing their kind. Rollo fired, with the sound of his forty-five loud in the chamber. His bullet wanged off alien armor, leaving a tiny dent. Their weapons made softer, popping sounds, and more mini-grenades flew. Two of them hit the vehicles on their side, and electric blue sizzling lines clawed over the top of my backhoe-like machine, flickering with color. I stepped back so I wasn't touching the vehicle. The last grenade sailed overhead and landed among tubed men and women. I twisted my neck to see what happened. Like a medusa of blue sizzling snakes, the electrical lines writhed wildly from the landed grenade, stroking the nearest tubes, but having no effect on the wide-eyed occupants inside. I noted the shot grenade's limited range. This must be more of their man-catching tech. I had to do something before the three of them clanked around my vehicle. From on the floor, I grabbed my left thigh and struggled upright onto one leg, leaning against the vehicle. Past the folded crane, I spied a Saurian mech, took deliberate aim and fired three quick shots at the one piece of his equipment that looked vulnerable, the visor. The last bullet did the trick, and the targeted Saurian staggered backward with a shattered visor and hopefully a gory, ruined face. He crashed onto the floor. A good sign. I ducked away and switched to my final magazine. There's one coming around to your right! Rollo shouted. I used my last grenade, tossing it up and over the vehicle onto the other side. The crump of the explosion and rattle of shrapnel against alien battle armor told me this was my chance. I wanted to roar like a berserk Viking. Instead... Silently psyching myself up as I used to do in Afghanistan, I forced myself around the vehicle. The Saurian still staggered, maybe from the force of the grenade's concussion. Hey, I said, to get his attention. He looked up. It seemed like a reflexive move. From point-blank range, I fired three times. Shards of visor and then drops of alien blood struck me as ricocheting bullets whined. He toppled back like a felled redwood, slamming against the deck plates. The last mech lifted his weapon, aiming at me from ten feet away. He would have killed me, or shocked me into a taser-like submission, but Rollo intervened. Despite his lanky frame, he could be like greased death at the oddest moments. This was one of those times. From behind the mech, Rollo charged and clambered up the Saurian's back, sticking the barrel of his browning against the visor. Blam, blam, blam! The creature from the stars ate it, and almost took Rollo down with him. My best friend roared and ripped himself loose from the mech's grip. Then he rolled across the floor as the Saurian soldier clanged to the deck in death and defeat. We'd won another encounter, but the ship's alarm still rang and I was down to half a magazine of bullets. We had to think of something else, or soon we'd be inside those tubes with the others. Chapter 4 We couldn't have much time left before the next enemy wave struck. It was move now or forever be an alien slave. Running away didn't seem like an option. They'd just hunt us down in the snowy wasteland of Antarctica. We had to go for the throat, for mastery of the lander. We needed more people, and we discovered a room full of them, if we could open the glass tubes. I checked the dead mechs for a useful smashing tool. I couldn't find one at first, but I did find something that looked interesting. I pulled off a half-moon curved blade from one of the dead aliens. Maybe it was the Saurian version of a bayonet. Come on, I told Rollo. Give me a hand. The nearest man inside a standing tube had a crew cut, a sweeping black mustache, and wide Slavic features. He was muscular, sported a Z tattoo on his right shoulder, and looked tough. Given that the Saurian had first tried to speak to us in Russian, I gave it high odds that the man in there was from that area of the world. He banged on his tube from the inside, yelling silently. 
I held up the curved knife and chipped at the cylinder. The blade scratched the glassy surface, but that was it. Wait a minute, Rollo said. I have a faster way. Like a kid, he climbed up and jumped into what must have been the driver's seat of the backhoe-like vehicle. As I'd said, the vehicle had a small crane with a clamp or claw holding the man-sized cylinder. The other cylinders stood upright in floor slots, as if they were high school test tubes for a science class. Rollo began experimenting, pressing buttons and pulling levers. The ship's alarm stopped, then, which seemed ominous, making it much too quiet. What were the aliens going to do next? Were they worried, calling for backup, or getting ready to storm in here with more mechs? As I wondered, growing more nervous, the backhoe-like vehicle purred into life. Stand back, Rollo told me. I stepped away from the upright cylinder. The man inside the tube twisted around, looking in alarm at Rollo. The crane proved more flexible than a backhoe. It was like one of the tentacles from War of the Worlds. Showing his aptitude for such things, Rollo soon laid the cylinder on the floor lengthways. Good thinking, I said. Rollo didn't even nod in acknowledgement. He was too busy concentrating. I suspect he knew the odds and our desperation. The single big claw gripping the tube began squeezing. Then Rollo took his hands off the vehicle's controls. What's wrong? I asked. I want to shatter the tube, Rollo said. But what if I end up cutting the man inside? Just get him out, I said. We can worry about wounds later. Rollo took a moment and then went back to the controls. Soon the claw made grinding noises, and suddenly the glass shattered, with shards falling onto the floor. Stop! I shouted. The claw stopped. I rushed forward and used the curved blade to pry away chunks of glass. Are you okay? I asked the trapped man inside. He blinked at me. Can you hear me? I asked. I wondered on his mental state. You are American, he said with a Russian accent. Yup, I said. Are you Russian? No, I am Dmitry Rostov, from Zaporizhia. Where? I asked. Zaporizhia, he said. It is in the Ukraine. You're Ukrainian? No, he said vehemently. I am a Zaporizhian Cossack. I'd heard of Cossacks, hard-riding, freedom-loving people from the steppes or plains of Russia and the Ukraine. They were supposed to be good fighters. Most people knew them as those acrobatic dancers who squatted low, folded their arms on their chests, and vigorously kicked out their legs. You were part of the old Soviet Union, right? I asked. Not anymore, he said. Now hurry! Get me out of here! We're working on it. I pried out a big glass chunk, nicking a finger so blood oozed, and finally I cleared away for him. You'll have to slither out, I said. I gave him a hand, and soon a stark naked Dmitri Rostov, the Zaporizhian Cossack, stood beside me. He was a solid, muscular man, shorter than my 6'3", and he looked angry and ready to do something about it. Did they use a pink ray on you? I asked. On all of us, he said. Now we must hurry and flee the ship. We're not fleeing, I said. We're going to hijack this thing and attack the big mother of a starship upstairs. Dimitri's eyes gleamed as a wild smile creased his face. Yes, he shouted. We attack. We kill the lizards. I agree. Saurians. Rollo said from the driver's seat. He used the flexible crane and claw to pluck another cylinder from the floor rack. He was in the process of laying the tube lengthways. We're calling the aliens Saurians, Rollo said. Dimitri nodded. It is good to name the enemy. Saurians. Yes, 
I approve. Now we must free the rest of the men and women before the aliens bring reinforcements. Are the others here Russians, Ukrainians, or Cossacks? I asked. I am the only Cossack here, Dmitri said. We are from the Russian base at Vostok, near the South Pole. Many of these people are former army soldiers. They are not Cossacks, but they should fight once I tell them your plan. He stroked his outrageous mustache. What is your plan? Do you see those dead Saurians on the floor? I asked. Yes, I see, he said. You're a clever fighter. I applaud you. That's what I'm going to do to the rest of the Saurians aboard the lander, I said. Afterward, that's what I'm going to do to the rest on the starship that started this. That is a good plan, Dimitri said. An excellent plan. You also have more guns, yes? Rollo cracked the next tube. As I began prying out shattered chunks of glass, I said, Nope, I'm almost out of ammo. We need more weapons. Maybe these alien long rifles and flare pistols will do. Anything in a storm, Dimitri said. His eyes gleamed then, and he grinned viciously. I wondered what the pink ray had done to his mind. Do you know the aliens have star armor? He said. As we talked, we helped out the next man. I didn't answer Dimitri's question because I was too busy talking to the new man. Unfortunately, he didn't speak any English. So Dimitri rattled off some quick instructions to him in Russian. With the claw, Rollo reached for the next tube. I pointed at the dead mechs. You mean that kind of armor? That's star armor? That is steel, Dimitri said. Mechanized body armor similar to what Russian and American soldiers use, or will use, in fifteen years. There's no Russia or America left, I said. Dimitri stared at me, and he grimaced. I don't know what he was thinking. Had he been married? Had he lost children? A wife? Surely his parents, aunts, uncles, or cousins? He looked up at the ceiling, and muscled cords stood up on his neck. A choked, grieving noise came from him once. He shook his head, then, swallowed, and he stared at me with shining eyes. We need guns, he said in a hoarse voice. Yeah, we need guns, I agreed. But we don't dare leave the ship to get more. The Saurians would seal all the hatches then, and we'd never get back on board. No. This is our one chance to hurt the enemy, and we have to make the most of it. Dimitri breathed deeply, and he said, They tested us before. Tell your friend to stand lookout in the corridor, I said. We don't want the lizards to surprise us. Yes, Dimitri said. That is wise. You think like a general. He grabbed his Russian friend by the triceps and spoke rapidly. The naked Russian picked up an alien long rifle and hurried to the entrance. The man had a bloody gash on his back. Getting out of the tubes proved troublesome, but the Russian hadn't complained. As I've said earlier, the tough and mean humans had survived the alien onslaught. These men and women in the tubes hadn't been idle. They must have kept their eyes open. From careful observation, they appeared to know how to use the alien weaponry. Whatever the pink ray did to a human mind wasn't lasting, at least. Dimitri and I pried out glass from yet another tube. Rollo worked faster now, having gotten the hang of the crane and claw. They tested us earlier, Dimitri told me. I heard you the first time, I said. The aliens have no soul. They're thorough bastards. I believe the... What did you call them? Dimitri asked. You had a name for aliens. Saurians! Rollo shouted from the vehicle. We're calling them Saurians! That is a good name, Dimitri said. It makes them sound evil. And they are, my friend. 
The Saurians want humans for a reason. Like the old Russians did with the Cossacks. The aliens wish humans to be soldiers for them. I only half heard Dmitri. His accent made it hard sometimes to know what he was saying. The fighting, the bad air in here, fatigue, maybe some of the after-effects of the pink ray all combined to dull my thoughts. Realizing that worried me. Were we thinking straight? I couldn't afford any mistakes. What had Dmitri just said? Something about the Saurians making us soldiers. No, I said. Not soldiers. The Saurians think we're beasts. No one is making me a convict again. Beasts! Animals! Yes! Dimitri shouted. The aliens tested some of us in a horrible manner. Several people died because of them. Two test subjects. I know the reason for the buzzing weapons. The Cossack's excitable. I frowned, trying to follow his words. Buzzing weapons? Oh, yeah, the alien projectiles act like taser grenades. Listen, my American friend, Dmitri said. I spoke to Ella Timoshenko about the tests. We spoke before the Saurian sealed us in the tubes. Ella is scientist. She's very smart and observant. Do you have a point? I asked. Yes, Dmitri said. I must show you. You are the general. You will know what we need to do about the star armor. Show me what? I asked. Then I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I turned and spied a naked woman. She was thin, with perfectly shaped breasts. She blinked in the manner of someone missing her glasses and had short brunette hair. Her eyes were sharp, and intelligence shone there. She noticed my scrutiny. She folded her arms before her breasts, glared at me, and spoke harshly in Russian. Dmitri protectively stepped in front of her, blocking my sight, and he spoke urgently to her. I suppose that was Ella Timoshenko. For a scientist, heck, for any woman, she had lovely tits and nice legs. I noticed Ella shaking her head as she spoke to Dmitri. The Cossack turned to me. Ella says we have no chance against the aliens. She says we should run away. Do you want to run, Dimitri? Do you want to let the aliens win? I am a Cossack. We have always fought, and we will always fight. I am with you, my general. But Ella, she is smart. I'm afraid we will lose in the end. Everyone dies, I said. So everyone loses in the end. That is not what the priests say, Dimitri said. About losing in the end? But you are right in saying we all die. It's living free that counts, I said. Standing your ground when the alien tries to cage you. You must see the star armor, my general. I'm sure it will help us. I could get used to Dimitri. Rollo, I said. Have one of those Russians work the crane. We have to keep attacking. We can't wait around for the aliens to make their next move against us. We have to keep surprising them until we win. Rollo didn't bother talking to the freed Russians. He jumped off the machine and grabbed one of the few alien weapons left. He must have noticed that the Russians were quick to arm themselves. Instead of one of the men, Ella Timoshenko climbed into the crane's control chair. She was nimble for a scientist. And those breasts. I looked away. As more Russians crawled out of the cracked tubes, they began working in shifts with the other backhoe-like vehicle. Its engine sounded like a buzzsaw and thumped from time to time. I wasn't sure how long it would run. I'd say we had forty people altogether, with seven free of the tubes so far. We're going to keep attacking, I told Dmitri. But we have to keep them off balance, I said. No, Dmitri said. Listen to me. You are a great fighter. You have killed aliens, and I don't know of anyone else who has done such a thing. I am forever in your debt. 
but you must see the star armor. Yeah, you talked about that. But I'm thinking, General, listen to me, please. Ella called it symbiotic armor. A living tissue mutated or grown for humans. What? I asked. Yes, Dimitri said. Now you're listening. You must come with me. I show you this thing. It makes more sense once you see it. I believe the Saurians made a critical mistake. By their translated words earlier, the lizards figured we humans were beasts, animals, or monsters. Wrong. We were thinking people, using every faculty to figure out what was going on. That included the trapped Ukrainians, Russians, and Cossack. Many of them were scientists, trained observers. Others had been former Russian soldiers. According to Dmitri, the Saurians had been conducting tests on them for two days already. One of those tests had included symbiotic armor, a kind of second skin for combat use. Why had the Saurians been testing the people? Dmitri said Ella had a theory, but the savant Ella Timoshenko had remained in the tube chamber to free the rest of the Russians. I'm not sure she liked me. Rollo, Dmitri, and I hurried down a corridor. Rollo had his forty-five and an alien long rifle. Dmitri carried the grenade pistol I'd picked up earlier, and I had my M14. Dmitri lacked clothes or shoes of any kind, but it didn't seem to bother him. The heat caused him to sweat, so he left wet footprints on the floor. The muggy air made our clothes soggy, and I kept shaking my head to fling sweat out of my eyes. The alien stench in the ship atmosphere had begun making me dizzy. I longed for good old fresh earth air. We're going to need water soon, I said, to keep us hydrated. There's plenty of snow outside, Rollo told me. Getting cold feet? I asked. Most definitely, he said. This lander freaks me out, and these corridors with their fuzzy walls. They're aliens, all right. It makes my gut clench every time I think about it. Why did the Saurians ever come here? This way, Dimitri said, pointing into a narrower corridor. Are you sure? I asked. The corridor looked darker like an alien cave I didn't want to go down. Dimitri grimaced. For the past two days, I have watched everything they do, cataloging each horror committed on us. I am sure. I didn't like it, but I motioned for Dimitri to keep going. He soon led us before another membrane. I'm a little tired of going through those, Rollo said. So was I, but I clutched my rifle and charged through. In my opinion, we'd run out of time. We'd been taking too long. I plopped through into an oven of a chamber that hit my face like a hellish brick. The room was one-third the size of the tube chamber. The back wall glowed orange with heat. I spied four raised pads near the wall with a blob of a shiny black substance on each of them. To my horror, the blobs oozed back and forth, the surface making rippling movements. Two long tables stood on the left side of the room. On each table lay a dissected human, with his or her chest cavity and stomach laid open. The corpse faces showed rigid horror and pain. What is this place? I asked. Rollo swore quietly in outrage. I glanced at my friend and then looked to the right where he stared. Three tall tubes filled with a green solution stood from floor to ceiling. Each of the cylinders contained a dead woman, with a hundred tiny wires connected to her. I vowed to save the last bullet and use it on myself. I wouldn't let myself be taken by these aliens and have things like that done to me. Yesterday? Dimitri said in a low voice. Ella and I were in here. I knew those people. Dimitri shook his head and spoke in an even lower whisper. 
Isaurians are vile beings from the stars. They conducted experiments. Ella and I... Dimitri stared at me with smoldering eyes. We wore the symbiotic armor. It was strange. Ella understood, though. In the past, she has often made intuitive leaps of understanding. I think she is psychic, or maybe even telepathic. What? I said. Ella knew, Dimitri said. She told me the Saurian plan. If you knew the reason why we were in Antarctica... Go on, I said. Because why? It does not matter now, Dimitri said. Those are your answer, he said, pointing at the rippling black blobs on the pads. We put those on and attack the aliens. Those will give us our chance. What in the hell is he talking about? Rollo asked me. That was a good question. Dimitri had to be among the whitest persons I'd ever seen. Canadians and Russians. No one could be as white as them. Now, however, Dimitri went even whiter. Swayed and might have toppled. I caught his right arm, steadying him. He swallowed several times. I don't want to do this, he whispered. But Cossacks fight to the end. We always fight. Are you okay? I asked. You know you're not making much sense, right? Dimitri pulled free of me. Like a stone zombie, he moved to the hot wall with the four blobs. Rollo sidled up to me, whispering. I think the Saurian scrambled his brains. I was tempted to agree, but the last few days had shifted my thinking about a lot of things. Maybe it helped that I'd read so much science fiction as a kid and watched every SF movie I could. I was used to strange concepts and weird ideas. Rhode Island-sized spaceships, death spores, saurians, and the greatest nations on Earth demolished in the space of a half hour? Why couldn't Ella have psychic flashes of understanding? The saurians had used a pink ray on our minds. Why couldn't our side have an advantage or two? Great. Do you see that? Rollo asked, with loathing in his voice. Dmitri Rostov reached one of the black blobs. Using both hands, he grabbed the jelly-like substance and heaved the thing off its pad, dumping the mass onto the floor where it quivered. Then he did the craziest thing. He stepped onto it with both feet. His feet disappeared into the blob, so he sank up to his ankles. He had a blood-oozing scratch on the inner left ankle on the ball joint. Then the slimy blob oozed up onto his legs, coating his flesh with the gooey black substance. Dimitri! I shouted. Be calm, my friends, he said, with his palms held outward toward me. I have done this before. This is the symbiotic armor, the living second skin. Ella believes these creatures were genetically engineered for human use. That thing is alive? Rollo asked. Oh, yes, Dimitri said. It is warm, and it feeds off our sweat. More of the blob oozed up Dimitri's legs. The stuff reached his knees and continued to climb like slime toward his waist. Is that what killed those people on the tables? Rollo asked, indicating the dissected corpses. I do not know, Dimitri said. Possibly. I swallowed hard. What I saw sickened me, but our backs were against the proverbial wall. Maybe we were Earth's last chance. Who else had fought their way onto an alien lander? I was almost out of bullets, and the aliens must be radioing for backup. I'd watched these beings murder my father. They'd nuked humanity practically out of existence. Now Dimitri said this was living armor. One of my player characters had worn living armor before in a role-playing game. I understood the concept of living armor. It was much different seeing it, though. 
a lot different. How much can I trust Ella Timoshenko? But no, maybe that was the wrong way to look at this. The better question was how much chance of victory did I have? In truth, I, we, had no chance at all against the aliens. If this stuff was living armor, and if it gave me some kind of advantage, but I don't know what it would give a person. What do you mean this is armor? I asked. What does it do for you? It amplifies your strength, Dimitri said. It also gives you energy and can harden its outer surface to deflect or stop certain kinds of attacks. Come on, guys, let's get out of here, Rollo pleaded. The black substance flowed up Dimitri's waist, past his belly button, and reached his shoulders when the first Saurian stepped through the membrane. I must have figured in the back of my mind that the Russians would race here and give us warning if the Saurians launched the next assault. What I failed to grasp was that the lizards didn't need to go past the Russians first. I should have realized there were many different ways to move about the ship. As foolish as it sounds on our part, the Saurians caught us by surprise. One after another, lizards rushed into the room. Many gripped a half-moon curved blade similar to that I'd taken off a mech lizard earlier. A wet green substance glistened along the edges of their blades. The first Saurian cut Rollo across the shoulder. My friend shouted in pain and surprise and threw himself away from the Saurian. As Rollo moved, his feet tangled and he tripped. I spun around and shot the nearest lizard in the face, the one going for me. I kept firing from the hip, taking down more. I backpedaled, shot another alien, and saw a Saurian crouch beside Rollo. My friend had stiffened strangely. The lizard held one of those curved knives, and it looked as if the Saurian planned to cut Rollo's throat. I aimed, pulled the trigger, and my rifle clicked empty. I was out of bullets. Croaking a desperate noise, Rollo finally managed to move, kicking feebly but not nearly hard enough. The half-moon curved blade came down, and it might have cut Rollo's throat and ended existence for my friend. Before that happened... A black-coated humanoid joined the fray. The thing punched the Saurian in the head. The creature catapulted off its three-toed talons and smashed against another of its kind. The two tumbled into a heap. I realized the black humanoid was Dimitri. The blob of symbiotic armor covered him from toes to just under his chin, leaving his head free. A fierce joyfulness twisted Dimitri's features into something unholy. Clearly, he liked wearing the armor, and he liked fighting. With amplified strength and heightened speed, Dimitri moved among the remaining Saurians. They cut at him, but could not penetrate the armor. They fired their weapons, and they died. I saw it. I can testify to the truth of what occurred. Several lizards slammed against bulkheads and crumpled to the floor. Others simply toppled down and flopped like snakes with Dimitri's blows hitting them like jackhammers. Then it was over. This wave of seven or eight Saurians failed, just as their previous efforts had. How many lizards were aboard the lander, anyway? Watching Dimitri in this horror show, I was beginning to believe we could actually win. Earlier, I'd figured, what better way to end life than to go down swinging? Now... Now I began to think we might really hijack the ship. Do you finally believe me? Dimitri asked. I would have answered, but I saw Rollo. The curved blade had sliced into his shoulder. There was a little blood, but not enough to cause what I was seeing. Rollo seemed to have frozen into immobility. The foul Saurians must have envenomed their blades with a paralyzing drug. They didn't fight fair, that's for sure. I feared for my friend. I had to do something for him, fast. Chapter 5 Dimitri had the answer for Rollo, but I didn't like it. I saw the loathing in Rollo's eyes and knew he positively hated the suggestion. But I had to do something for him. 
Before I subjected my friend to this alien horror, I figured I should try it first. Tell me one thing, I told Dimitri. Are you still sane? The Zaporizhian Cossack paused before answering the question. You are human, right? I asked. Dimitri grinned wryly. I hesitate to answer because the living armor must lace chemicals into me through my skin. When I fought just now, I felt good. Yes, I am sane, but I believe it makes me want to fight when I wear the armor. Ella said yesterday that the symbiotic creature seemed biosculpted for us. What did she mean by that? I asked. How do you Americans say it? Dimitri mused. Bioengineered, yes. The creature was bioengineered for our use. So you think the Saurians have been studying humanity for some time? I asked. It seems self-evident, yes, my general. I'm not a general, I said. I'm just an American grunt who used to work for Black Sand. Dimitri looked crestfallen. But I'll keep fighting, I said. I'll lead us to the end. He nodded, grinning at me. I took a deep breath, with a hot alien air burning down my throat. It reminded me of the worst smoggy day in L.A. when I'd played basketball in high school. I felt like I'd been drowning after a while, each breath painful in my throat. While wearing the symbiotic armor, Dimitri had just fought like Superman or the Hulk. I'd like to do that. But did I trust a blob of living armor, a creature that would flow onto me like a second skin? What if it covered my face? That would obviously suffocate me. According to Ella, the mystic Russian scientist with the nice breasts, the Saurians had bioengineered the armor for humans. The aliens are too strong, Dimitri said. You have no choice, my... I glanced at him. I had lots of choices, as long as I didn't mind losing. With a roar of frustration, I tore off my parka, shirt, and unlaced my boots. In seconds, I stood naked in the chamber. This was crazy. I felt like a lunatic. What drove me in the end was the fact that humanity had nearly been exterminated. To come back from the edge of extinction, someone had to do something. The dissected corpses on the table and the dead floating in the tubes meant I had to grab this chance. In my humble opinion, we were dead otherwise. Naked. With my heart pounding, I approached a quaking, quivering blob on a raised pad. The living armor hadn't come from Earth, but from some lab in the stars. The Saurians sure hadn't worn this stuff to help them tackle us. That should have warned me, right? With serious distrust riding on my shoulders, I grabbed the substance. It was warm, like a fresh pancake, and it pulsed as if it had a heart rate. I heaved, lifted it off the pad, and plopped it onto the floor. Then I stepped onto the squishy blob. Now it was my turn to watch it slither and ooze onto my skin. The stuff was warm, and watching it creep up my legs nearly freaked me out. I wanted to howl and leap away, scraping this gunk off with my knife. I felt something then. The armor's displeasure. The advance halted. You must accept it, Dimitri said. I believe it senses negative emotions. That was just great. This stuff was like a dog that knew when you were afraid. I tried to take a calming breath. It didn't work because of the smogginess and the stench of the alien atmosphere. Sweat pooled on my skin and a bout of claustrophobia threatened to steal my logical processes. I was seconds away from howling. I glanced at Rollo, sprawled on the deck plates. If this didn't work, I don't know what we were going to do. I couldn't lug him out of the lander. This latest Saurian assault showed the lizards hadn't given up. 
If nothing else, they could simply take off and return to the mothership. That would end our chances. We had to do something now, or it wouldn't matter. You gotta relax, Creed, I told myself. Yeah, relax, as I was engulfed by living alien technology. I focused on my old man. Mad Jack could have done this. He would try anything experimental. If I wanted to raise a tombstone to my dad, I had to beat the Saurians. I had to accept this slime. Hey, I told the blob. I love you. This is the best thing that ever happened to me. You gotta turn me into the Hulk and we'll stomp the shit out of these Saurians, okay? They must have agreed, because the dark substance started oozing again, climbing my skin and enfolding me in warmth. This sensation wasn't like the alien heat. As the second skin relaxed against my epidermis, I felt a good warmth. I felt comfortable. That decreased my tension, my anxiety, and that speeded the process. How does it know not to cover my mouth? I asked Dimitri. He shrugged. Oh, yeah, that helped. Not. I grinned at Rollo because I noticed he was watching me. His skin had a touch of green, and he squirmed slowly as if in pain. Great, he said. His lips had stiffened. Put the stuff on him, I told Dimitri. No, Rollo said. Please, no. The Saurians put poison on their blades, I told Rollo. Dimitri said the living armor can help draw it out of you. Why not try it and see what happens? Rollo began to breathe raggedly. We never should have come aboard. I know it, I said. The living armor spread across my chest. I no longer noticed the crappy air in here. Even better, I felt as if I floated. I felt healthy. I mean, 100% well inside. This armor, maybe there was something to it. Dimitri tore off Rollo's clothes. Rollo tried to work his mouth, but it had stiffened too much for him to speak. He groaned, and his fingers twitched. He didn't want the stuff. First mumbling a Cossack prayer in Russian, and then winking at Rollo, Dimitri set a blob on my friend's bare legs. My second skin reached my throat and touched the soft flesh underneath my chin. I grew tense, and the living armor halted its advance. I squatted low and lifted a foot. The outer surface of the armor on the bottom of my foot had become like hard rubber. I tapped the surface armor on my arm. It was like dense rubber. I went to my pile of discarded clothes and drew my combat blade. It was a big, buoy style knife, almost a small short sword. This sucker was razor sharp, and the handle fit into my living armored hand like it was custom made for me. I'd had a thing for knives for a long time. My stepdad had especially hated me throwing knives against our barn door. That had been during seventh grade in junior high school. I bought three throwing knives at a surplus store and had thudded them against the barn door for hours. I'd left two hundred marks or holes in it. My stepdad had walloped me good for that. Later, I'd made a target out of plywood. I could hit the centerpiece from thirty paces away nine times out of ten. Not that I had any intention of throwing the buoy. It was a fighting blade for hand-to-hand -hand combat. What did I know about that? In prison, there had been a thin little book written by a con from San Quentin. I'd read it fifty times and spoken to others. It had concerned prison knife fighting. There had been little fancy about it. One kept the blade close and used it with a fast thrust. In and out, baby. Sometimes a fighter didn't let you get close. The trick then was to cut him, let him bleed and weaken. The point to all this was I knew something about knife fighting. A mean and ugly style meant for quick results. There wasn't anything gentlemanly about knife fighting. It was a combat technique meant to eliminate your enemy without causing any hurt to yourself. How are you feeling? I asked Rollo. 
The living armor spread over him like a disease. It had flowed over the envenomed cut. Rollo's eyelids fluttered, and he began to stir. I flexed my biceps. Is there a trick to smashing the lizards like you did earlier? I asked Dimitri. Act as you would normally, he said. The living armor will supply you with extra power. We have the armor, I said. But I'm out of bullets, and I don't really trust our alien grenades. We need to kill them, not just knock the lizards out of the battle. What are we going to do about the Saurians and the tanks? Rollo asked. He sat up. The paralysis had gone, although his right eyelid drooped, half hiding that eye. Dimitri had been right about the armor. How do you feel? I asked. Woozy, Rollo said. And thirsty. Can you walk? Give me a second, Rollo said. I kept my gaze away from the corpses on the tables and the dead women floating in the cylinders. That was the price for losing. Do you know the layout of the ship? I asked Dimitri. Ella said something about the lower levels being used for storage and the higher decks being the ship functioning areas. If Ella's right, I said, and we'll have to bet she is, that would mean the control room is at the very top. That is good thinking, Dimitri said. Rollo grunted as he heaved up onto his feet. He glanced at my bowie knife and raised an eyebrow. Remember how I told you I've been to prison? I said. I remember. I'll stick to this, Rollo said, hefting his Browning forty-five in one hand and an alien grenade-launching pistol in the other. How much ammo do you have left? I asked. Two more magazines, Rollo said. Dimitri, you ready? I asked. I have been ready ever since you broke me out of the test tube, the stocky Cossack said. Let's do it, then, I said. Let's hunt down the aliens and kill every Nazi experimenting one of them. Chapter 6 The three of us moved through the alien lander as if it was the end of the movie time. You know how during the beginning of an action movie the hero usually does something super cool? Then he gets caught or the villain beats the crap out of him in a nasty way and steals his girlfriend. After a long time of getting ready and building up for the grand fight, the hero and his team smashes into the bad guy's fortress and proceeds to blow everyone down until the final confrontation and movie twist. Dimitri, Rollo, and I now smashed through the lander, sweeping down the corridors and entering small rooms, chambers, and fuzzy-walled corridors of varying sizes and complexity. We found more tube chambers. Some of the upright cylinders held people. Others proved to be empty. Everywhere we killed Saurians. Rollo ran out of bullets, but he found the shock grenade gun to his liking. He stayed in the back, firing into groups of Saurians, knocking down some and slowing down others with the electrical discharges. Dimitri wielded a long bar of iron, and he continued to parody the Hulk. Once he smashed a lizard's head clean off the body. Blood jetted from its neck while the Saurian jerked like a slaughtered chicken and ran against a wall before flopping around on the floor. I used the bowie knife, and my living armor no longer looked black, but was slick with green-dripping Saurian blood. The suits pumped us with something, maybe a fast-acting drug to put us into a steroid rage. I felt elation at the slaughter, and I felt powerful, approaching invincible. The only trouble was a dry mouth. I really needed water. At times, my vision turned splotchy. How much farther do you think it's to the top of this thing? Rollo asked. We strode along a wide corridor that went upward like a ramp to a pair of double doors. They were the first normal doors we'd seen. Everything else had been protected by a membrane. The doors ahead of us swished open, and the biggest Saurian I'd seen so far limped out. Behind him in the room, I saw small windows showing an Antarctic storm outside. That was a relief. It let me know the lander was still on Earth. 
I'd wondered if I'd feel it if the ship took off into space. In the room, I spied stools, lizards in crinkling-looking suits near what seemed like controls. If I were to guess, we'd reached our destination. The lander's control chamber. As the doors swished shut behind him, the big saurian strode toward us on his springy legs, with his long tail dragging and making clinking noises against the floor. This lizard seemed hoary with age, with a billy goat's beard under his scaly jaws, and standing as tall as a man, a six-footer. The old one's scales looked dimmer than the others, and a crust of something encircled his eyes. He also wore more of the crinkly material, and what seemed to be symbols showing his rank and golden rings around his tail. They were what made the noise as he approached. I knew a little about lizards and reptiles. As a kid, I'd read up on everything I could concerning dinosaurs. For one thing, they kept growing as long as they lived. The biggest crocodile was always the oldest one. I was beginning to believe the same held true for the Saurians. Did this old one run the lander? Why had he come alone? Was he surrendering? Rollo raised his alien pistol at the lizard. Wait, I said. He's trying to stall us, Rollo said. This is a trick. The old one wore a device on his chest, which hung from a band around his neck. He touched the device, lifted a microphone, or what looked like a microphone, and spoke into it. You must cease this senseless attack. The words boomed in English from the translator on his chest. He had gall, I'll give him that. Are you surrendering? I asked. I had a good reason for not wanting Rollo to fire. I knew the membranes couldn't stop us, but locked metal doors might. The doors behind the old one seemed solid. If I could, I'd try to talk my way into the control room. Your words lack meaning, the old one told me concerning surrender. You are prey, beasts, animals. We're people, I said, feeling a prickliness in my chest. I was more than sick of their arrogance, but I had to contain that for a greater goal. Answer my question. Are you surrendering? If you are, I give you my word of honor, we'll let you live. Go back to the chambers, the old one said. Remove the battle suits and the family will deliver you to the Jelk. What family? I asked. What are you talking about? He's trying to mess with your mind, Rollo said. Kill him and smash into the control room. Do you hear my friend? I asked. He wants to kill you. Why shouldn't I gut you right here? You need to give me a reason to keep you alive. For you to kill me goes against the natural order of reality, the old one said. You are fighting beasts that have run amok. The family's duty is to destroy you lest you contaminate the others. However, in this instance, I will bring you to the Jelk. You must leave this area, return to the chambers, and remove the battle suits. Did you feel that? Rollo asked me. I knew what he meant. The deck plates under my feet vibrated more than before, as if I stood on a hard, revving bulldozer. A loud whine penetrated through the bulkheads. If I were to guess, I'd say the Saurians had started the engines and were getting ready to leave Antarctica. I'm giving you a last chance, I told the old one. Surrender the vessel to my control and you can live. This is obscene, the old one said. You have aborted the sequence of reality. The Jelk will be displeased. I'm displeased, I said. No, you are beasts. You are... I could see where this was going. Nowhere and I was tired of being called a beast. I'd given him his chance. Now I was going to act. In three swift strides, I reached the old Saurian. The engines roared and the deck plates shivered with power. I used the bowie knife and thrust the steel through his squat neck. 
Then I threw the dead old one from me and lunged at the doors. They didn't open. The entire corridor swayed, and thunderous noises swept through us. The floor slid out from under me, and I realized the lander must be lifting off the rocky soil of Antarctica. We have to get in there, Rollo shouted. None of this matters if we can't break into the control room. Despite the roar and the vibration, I climbed up and put my green dripping hands against the doors and heaved sideways. The doors groaned in a tortured way, but they held their place. Give me a hand, I shouted. We have to get in there. The other two rushed forward, and each of us strained against the doors, trying to slide them open. The corridor tilted even more, and the old one's corpse slid away from the double doors. This vehicle must be headed into space. They locked the doors, Rollo said. I thrust my bowie knife underhanded at the crack between the doors. The blade went in several inches. I shoved with everything I had. Inch by inch, the steel blade slid deeper between the doors. What's your plan? Rollo shouted. I yanked on the blade, trying to force the doors open. Push! I shouted. One of you per door! The three of us exerted all the considerable strength of our living armor-enhanced muscles. I yanked on the bowie knife, using it as a lever. I expected it to snap at any moment. Instead, we slid open the doors several inches so I could peer into the control room. Saurians turned toward us in surprise. Give me your pistol, I wheezed. While keeping one hand pressed against the door, Rollo shoved me his gun. Through the small crack, I fired two shock grenades into the control room. Saurians dodged to get away, but to little avail. The grenades sizzled with blue arcing lines, and lizards began flopping about in the room. Give it everything, I said. It's now or never. It turned out to be now, because we forced the doors wide enough for me to slither through. The blood dripping from my suit helped grease my way. Then the portal banged shut behind me. Two remaining, sorry-looking, half-shocked lizards sat hunched at their stations. They were stubborn creatures. We had that much in common. The chamber was like a quadruple-sized cockpit of a regular jumbo jet, with seven saurians in attendance. Five lay tased on the floor. Two tapped frantically on their panels. The windows showed the darkening of approaching space, with stars beginning to appear. The lander obviously headed for their mothership. I started toward them. One of the saurians hissed. The other slapped a button, and weightlessness came to the control room, for I found myself floating in midair. Fortunately, my forward momentum still kept me heading toward them. The lizards didn't wait on the stools, however. Each leapt away from me, soaring through the chamber to another location. I reached a stool soon enough and leapt after the nearest one. The next few minutes proved tedious and frustrating. The two lizards were much more agile in the weightless chamber than I was. At times they used their tails, thrusting off the bulkheads, or using them to reach and shove, adjusting their flight paths. I kept sailing after them in an attempt to catch one or to cut it with my bowie knife. This went on long enough so several of the frozen saurians on the floor began to stir. That changed the tactics of the two survivors. They landed near one of their own, shaking him and hissing urgently, trying to speed his revival. All the while, the lander headed for space. The last blue of Earth's atmosphere had already faded to black, and now the stars blazed in profusion. What would I do with seven saurians, seven flying monkeys moving in crisscrossing patterns through the chamber? This couldn't go on. I had to stop the lander and bring it back to Earth. Or barring that, I had to stop it before the vessel reached the mothership. Therefore, I changed tactics. This wasn't a game or a sporting proposition. This was life or death. Extinction or the continuation of the human race. That meant bitter ruthlessness. No one would give me a prize for playing fair. It was either win or lose. Prison had taught me some bitter lessons. The most critical of those lessons was to cheat when the stakes became high enough. I cheated now by landing on or beside the five stirring saurians. 
I killed each one, finding I had to hold the head in order to cut the throat. Otherwise, I'd merely push myself away as I attempted to ply my blade in the weightless situation. You shouldn't have come to Earth, I roared at one, feeling guilty at this slaughter. You should have left us alone. After finishing off the last of the five, we played the game in earnest, the two survivors and I. Like a hungry, angry wolverine, I chased them up and down and side to side throughout the compartment. They used every trick, I suppose, in weightless maneuvering. I learned fast, and I'd always been good at pool. It was all about angles, figuring them out and using them to your advantage. My living armored hand finally caught a saurian by the tail. The lizard thrashed, and at the last moment I felt the muscles of the tail bunch and writhe like a python. The creature became desperate and launched itself at my head. It was a smart move, for it made the most sense, as my head was the one vulnerable spot left. It didn't help the saurian, but given his situation, it's what I would have done in his place. We hugged, and I punched my blade into him. The tip must have hit a bone, momentarily blocking my thrust. Then I could feel the blade grating against it, sawing into the hard structure. I twisted the knife to make him die as fast as I could, and to get the edge off the bone. Afterward, my back bumped against a bulkhead. What's it gonna be? I shouted at the last Saurian. Surrender? Show me how to work the controls and I'll let you live. Yeah, my word. The last Saurian crouched against the far wall. His eyes were glassy, and he kept his lizard mouth open as he panted. You'll die unless you surrender, I said. He watched me, but it seemed clear he had no idea what I said. Why didn't he get a translator? Maybe it had something to do with him seeing me butcher his pals. Also, he must have thought of me as an animal gone berserk. Would I try to reason with a blood-maddened tiger that had just clawed and bit six of my friends to death? I almost pitied him, until I remembered the dissected corpses on the tables and the dead floating in the tubes. These lizards treated us like animals. This one merely reaped the reward of his kind's cruelty to our world. I glanced at the windows. Great. We were in space. I had to gain control of the lander, and that fast. I roared at him and faked with my head. He was twitchy, this last Saurian. He leaped, but I stayed where I was. No doubt recognizing his mistake, his tail lashed out for a stool to redirect his flight path. I heaved his dead buddy at him. Then I launched myself. The dead Saurian struck the living one. And that's all the chance I needed. In these grisly moments of hack, slash, and spill green blood, I'd gotten a lot better at weightless maneuvering. The gruesome game ended with his death. I panted as I yanked my buoy out of his chest. With all this jumping and pushing, I'd become thirstier than ever. Now I had to concentrate. I floated to the controls, or to one set of them. I tried to remember which button the lizard had pushed that had turned off the gravity. Maybe it was this one. I pressed it, and I thudded hard onto the floor. I missed striking my chin on a panel by the barest fraction. Standing, I wondered what I should do next. Rollo shouted from the other side of the doors. Creed! Are you okay? What's going on in there? I strode across the bloody chamber with its lizard corpses and pulled a lever that looked like it should open the portal. It worked. The doors swished open. Listen up, I said. The two men stared at me. I imagined I was a sight, with a green bloody face, and as I clutched my gory buoy, their glances took in the dead lizards. You killed them all, Rollo said. I try to get them to surrender first, I said. Who's going to pilot the ship? Rollo asked. His girlfriend, I said, pointing at Dimitri. Get Ella up here pronto. We have to figure out these controls before we reach the mothership. 
There may be some Saurians left hiding on our lander, Dimitri said. Rollo, go with him, I said. Kill every lizard you find. But you two have to hurry. We're running out of time. What are you going to do? Rollo asked. I'll start messing with the controls to see if I can figure something out. I know you are cunning, Dimitri said. And I do not question your wisdom. But is it not possible you might accidentally open the outer locks and let out the air if you mess with the controls? The Cossack had a point. Okay, I said. Ella is supposed to be Miss Brainiac, right? Brainiac? Dimitri asked. Smart, wise, uh, mystic scientist with good guesses, I said. Yes, Dimitri said. She is very smart. So go get her. Until she comes, though, I'm going to try things. It's how we've gotten as far as we have. I'm not going to play it safe now. Dimitri gave a worried glance at the lander's controls. Go, I said. We have to get the ship turned around. And see if you can find us something to drink. Or I'm going to turn vampire and start sipping their blood. Dimitri gave me a strange look. It is said the Mongols, when they lacked other nourishment, used to open a vein on their horse and drink its blood. After the Zaporizhian Cossacks, the Mongols were the world's greatest warriors. Drinking alien blood makes us great? I asked. Likely, if you drank their blood, it would be poisonous to you. I blinked several times, studying our Cossack. Get Ella, I said. And do it now! Dimitri nodded curtly, and he went. Rollo raised an eyebrow at me, and then he went, too. Chapter 7 I sat in the control chamber with Ella Timoshenko. She wasn't naked anymore, although she was still barefoot. She put on Rollo's parka as if it was a dress leaving her legs exposed. She peered intently at the various panels, no doubt trying to decipher their functions. So far, she'd avoided looking at me, and it said even less. Dimitri and Rollo stalked the lander, hunting for Saurians. I told them to cleanse this craft of alien invaders. It was an Earth ship now, our only one. I intended on keeping it that way. I badly needed water. I suspect we all did. My lips were chapped, and the armor had begun to stir restlessly on my skin. There had to be a water source aboard ship. How otherwise had the aliens kept the Russians alive for two days? I would have asked Ella. I'd heard her speak to Rollo and knew our scientist spoke broken English so we could communicate. But she had a graver task to perform just now. We desperately needed to gain control of our ship. Ella had narrow, pretty features with a little triangular-shaped chin. She continued to blink like a woman missing her glasses. She turned her head toward me but refused to look in my eyes. Was she shy or still upset with me? This must be life support, she said, indicating a panel. So never touch these controls. Did she think I was an idiot or a Neanderthal? Sure thing, I said. Ella stood. She had nice legs. She wiped her hands against the parka's fabric and moved to the next stool. She carefully sat down, pulling the parka around her. Then she began to inspect the new panel. Soon she rubbed her forehead shook her head and gave me another side glance. I cannot be certain, she said. I get that, I said. I'm amazed you can tell anything at all. But our time is becoming more critical by the second. We have to try something. The lander's engine still throbbed, and the ship presumably blasted at takeoff speed toward parts unknown. How long would it take the mothership to notice us? How many landers did the aliens possess? If a few, they would notice sooner. 
If hundreds, well, maybe we still had a chance. We operated in the dark, but we were lucky to be in this position at all. Ella Timoshenko spread her slender hands over the panel, wriggled her fingers, and dared to touch a control. The vibration under our feet quit in an instant. I glanced at her. That was impressive. Maybe our scientists did indeed possess intuitive abilities. I have shut off the engine, she informed me. How in the world did you know to press that control? I asked. Whether out of modesty, because she was too busy thinking, or found talking to me too difficult, she just shook her head and went back to studying the panel. At that moment, a screen to my left flickered with images. I must have noticed it with my peripheral vision. I turned toward the wall screen and saw a saurian. It peered at me. This one had discolored scales around its left eye. My stomach nodded. The bastards had found us. There went our element of surprise. We could still ram them, though. I didn't want to die, but I wanted to float in a specimen jar even less. I could give them the finger a second before impact. My upper lip curled. The Saurian must be some kind of traffic control operator. Likely he was on the mothership, checking in on the lander. The lizard hissed at me. I wished I could have shot him in the head. Can you turn off that screen? I whispered to Ella out of the corner of my mouth. She looked up and must have seen the lizard for the first time. She gave a sharp gasp before saying, I am not certain. No, not immediately, she added. I faced the lizard. After chasing the two saurians around in this chamber, I had begun to distinguish their expressions. Clearly, the lizard operator didn't like what he saw. He spoke sharply before his image disappeared. I stood, and I considered smashing the screen. Before I could proceed, another image appeared on the screen. A human-looking alien wearing a dark jacket turned around and faced me. He appeared to be listening to someone speaking off-screen, out of my sight. Maybe it was the lizard operator reporting to him. The man had blood-colored skin and narrow features. He had dark, extremely intelligent-seeming eyes. When he opened his mouth, I noticed pointy teeth like a piranha. The alien spoke, or his mouth moved. From a speaker under our screen came saurian-like hisses. Are you seeing this? I asked Ella. He must be the jelk, Ella said in a low voice. I turned to the scientist. She had been staring at me. The minute our eyes met, hers dropped. This is ridiculous, I said. We're not at a dance. We're about to die. Her gaze lifted, and she glared now. You stared at me before? Yeah, well, I couldn't help it. You're pretty. Now, what's a joke? She glared for a moment longer. Then the outrage in her eyes flickered off, and she had a business look, a coldly logical expression. The Saurian spoke about the Jelk. I remember being intrigued, as it seemed clear the Jelk controlled the expedition. So that's the Saurian's boss, I whispered. Ella glanced around me at the screen. She nodded, adding, Most certainly. I turned back to the Jelk. This was the bastard I had to kill who must have ordered the thermonuclear bombs rained onto Earth. The Joker must be on the mothership. He regarded me closely, and a cruel smile appeared. Those eyes. They showed wicked intelligence. Something twisted like a biblical demon. I had the impression of advanced age. That daunted me. He spoke again, and instead of hisses, English words came out of the speaker. You are humans, earthlings, 
he said. Obviously, I said. Are you the jelk? His eyebrows rose, and I found that disconcerting. Aliens from the stars should be different in thought and actions from us, right? Those raised eyebrows were a human-like gesture. What did it mean if we had similar facial gestures? Ah, he said. You wear a symbiotic battlesuit. I begin to perceive the situation. The chamber shows stains of combat. Yes, you have gained control of the vessel. How foolish of the family. I had thought they could collect specimens without endangering themselves. You earth beasts are more cunning than the indicator showed. My gut tightened. Beasts. This joker called us beasts, too. What was with these aliens? Were they all a bunch of arrogant pricks? I breathed heavily, and I told myself getting angry wouldn't help me now. But I couldn't stop myself. Why do you believe we're beasts? I asked. The smile widened as if he was amused with me. It is self-evident, he said. No, I said. We're talking, right? Speech implies intelligence. How interesting, he said. You attempt to reason with me. Very well. If it's logic you desire, I will accommodate you for the moment. Your lander capturing feat deserves a reward. I am in fact impressed with you. You wear a bio-battle suit. That was a clever tactic. I couldn't understand his calm. We had his lander. We'd killed his saurians. But he didn't seem concerned with their deaths. It told me he was cold-hearted. I suppose I already knew that, since he was genocidal. You claim to have risen above the level of beasts, he said. Yet I know that a few short years ago your species avidly attempted to destroy each other. Our XT sociologist studied Earth several cycles ago. At the time, he leaned toward the screen and pressed three fingers against his forehead. If I were to guess, it looked as if he was thinking or attempting to recall facts. Ah, now I remember, he said, confirming my suspicion. The German Imperium attacked the Soviet Empire, creating widespread destruction. At the same time, the American techno-wizard solved the atomic equation and annihilated Japanese militarists. I glanced back at Ella. She didn't notice. With her features scrunched in thought as she observed, she obviously studied the jelk. A light bulb went off in my head. The atomic equation did it for me. You're talking about World War II, I said. You had observers watching us back then? The Jelk showed off his pointy teeth. He might look human, but he wasn't the same as us. Animals destroy in a reflexive manner, he said. The civilized solve in a constructive way. The genocidal freak was a hypocrite. I'd had my fill of them. Oh, sure, I said. Civilized. That's why you nuked the earth and sowed death spores everywhere, right? Unsurprisingly, you labor under misinformation, he said. It was not I who did these things, but the Lokars. Uh-oh, I heard Ella say behind me. The engine has come back online. I glanced at the Russian. Her fingers were pressed against a panel. At the same time, I felt the vibration under my feet. Did you turn the engines back on? I whispered. Ella looked up at me, and she bit her lower lip. Negative. I think he did it. You are observant, the Jelk said. That's another point in your favor, I suppose. 
Yes, you've noticed that my operators have taken remote control of the craft. In several time units, you will join the fleet. I remember the police driving me to prison. I'd sat in the back of a police car, with my wrists handcuffed. Fear had filled me then. I'm not letting this prick capture me. He thinks I'm an animal. Remember those dissected people on the tables? I rubbed the back of my hand against my lips. Maybe there was a way to short-circuit the remote control. We had battle suits and some alien weaponry. I wasn't about to call it quits just because this grinning bastard spoke to me in a high-handed manner. It appears your rationality is lower than you realize, the Jelk said. Keeping my features neutral, I faced him. Yeah? How do you figure? Why would I eliminate your species in a violent act of destruction, and then send down craft to collect specimens for bio-battlesuit testing? You tell me, I said. The smile evaporated, and the coldness of his dark eyes became more pronounced. You are a rash creature, too full of your own importance. I suppose your present feat has puffed up your hubris to inordinate levels. No, Earth Beast, that a single command from me will cause the atmosphere in your vessel to flee into the vacuum of space around you. You threatening to kill us? I asked. Call me Beast one more time. Mister, I said. I've been ready to die for a while now. A threat is not an action, the Jelk said. It is instead a possibility. You may yet live, but that will depend on the next few moments and what you decide. I wanted to shove his face against a block of cement and grind it to paste, but I was unable to think of anything useful to say, so I just nodded. Interesting, he said. You now exhibit caution. Maybe the observers underrated human intelligence. In any case, as I was saying, your rationality, your reason, is weak. The Jelk Corporation does not waste resources. The assault upon your planet... Hmm, he said. I suspect that the Lokars feared you enough to act aggressively. It is possible they learned of my plan and attempted to neutralize my recruiting grounds before I could reach this system. Yes, Ella whispered behind me. The aliens want us as soldiers. I was right all along. What are you saying? I asked the Jelk. You wanted to hire humans as mercenaries in a galactic war? Again, you misunderstand. The Jelk Corporation does not indulge in war, not in the style or manner of beasts. The Lohars, however, do not abide by civilized conduct. They are a betweener species, climbing upward from beastliness to sophistication. Not only was he irritating, but confusing. Who are the Lohars? I asked. Is that your name for the Saurians? How you strive for understanding, the Jelk said. I applaud that. Yet it is difficult for you to comprehend concepts beyond your intellect to process. You are a fighting beast with the rudiments of rationality. That you wear the bio-battle suit and have destroyed the workers proves it. He pressed his fingertips against his forehead. I had not anticipated this pseudo-intelligence. Perhaps I can recoup my investment after all. He removed his hand, and his smile reappeared. This wouldn't be the first time that the Jelk on the spot understands better than the policymakers back in the conglomerate. Listen to me, Earth Beast. 
Comprehend, if you can, the offer I'm about to make you. I don't think I've ever wanted to squeeze anyone's neck more. I felt helpless, and I had no idea how to fix this. If he wanted us as mercenaries, that would be one thing. But this idea I was a beast? The joke cleared his throat. The sound had a gritty quality, like a two-pack-a-day smoker. I had planned to use you Earth Beasts as ground troops. There are enough transports en route to move several hundred million of you. Once you had been put to cryogenic sleep, of course. The bio-battlesuits were an investment. Oh, never mind. I'm sure you cannot comprehend. The point is that now a paltry few million of you have survived the planetary bombardment. Your amazing feat of conquering a lander and taking it into space? I believe I can recoup expenditures by taking the best of you and rearming you as space assault troopers. You appear to possess enough wit to successfully operate in a vacuum and weightless environment. Was I hearing this right? Let me get this straight, I said. You're offering to hire us as space mercenaries? Crudely stated, but accurate to a point, he said. My thoughts threatened to whirl around and around. I didn't want to end up dissected on a table, and I dreaded the idea this slug was lying. I didn't want to live the rest of my days in an alien cage, either. But fighting space wars as a mercenary? Won't the Saurians want revenge for what I've done to them? I asked. By Saurians? Oh, I see. You're referring to the family. Certainly the workers would prefer to see you destroyed, but that has no bearing on my offer. The Saurians... The family works for you? I asked. They are mere workers indeed, the Jelk said. Their poor martial performance against you attests to their lack of fighting ingenuity, at least in face-to-face -face encounters. A truly combative species would have quashed your struggle at the outset. And if I refuse your offer? I asked. The Jelk appeared surprised. Come, come. The outcome of refusal is obvious on several levels. At the most lenient, if I returned you to Earth, you would die within the next few weeks from the bio-terminator lacing the air. But, of course, I won't return you, but simply let vacuum and space take care of your sullen aggressiveness. Then I will gather other humans as my space assault troopers. I didn't like him. I didn't trust him or the Jelk Corporation he represented. But he controlled the ship's engine, and I believed he had the power to back up his threats. Besides, I was thirsty, hungry, and wondering how to get the bio suit off me. If we become your mercenaries, I said, how will you pay us? His eyebrows rose again, and those dark eyes glittered. You will be fed, housed, given medical treatment and sexual servitors. I interrupted. It was clear we'd be his fighting slaves. He thought of us as animals, after all. But I had plans that didn't include serving the Jelk Corporation my entire life. A judge had once sent me to prison, but I'd found a way out of that. First, I had to survive, and I had to help the last remnants of humanity endure our world's destruction. I have one request as part of our payment, I said. Speak, he said. I'm listening. You spoke about millions having survived the Lohar attack, I said. But it seems clear the Earth has become uninhabitable, or nearly so. Quite, he said. It seems to me you're probably not going to recruit all of the survivors, I said. No, he said. 
it wouldn't be profitable. My payment is that you house the survivors, helping them overcome the Bioterminator. His upper lip lifted, showing me those pointed teeth of his. Am I to understand that you believe your service can pay for such costly planetary reconstruction? Think about it for a moment, I said. I led these humans with nothing but our wits and fighting ability. We beat your Saurians, even though they had every advantage. I realized the Jelk Corporation had observers here once. Yet you've already admitted that they failed to fully appreciate our abilities. We humans fight a whole lot better if we feel we're fighting for something noble and useful. Your space assault troopers will give you their best if they know back home humanity still exists, that they're buying that existence with their sweat and blood. I find it interesting how you ape civilized behavior, the Jelk said. Hmm. I do have several ventures that could use highly motivated assault troops. I suppose I could land a freighter or two on the surface, dismantling. He paused, thinking for a moment. Then he held up one of his red-skinned hands. Earth Beast, I agree to your proposal. I had no idea if he kept his word or not. If he was lying... I went for Broke and asked him how I could trust him. He made barking noises. I learned later that it was Jelk laughter. You can trust me, he said, because you have no other options. Refuse, and the last of your species, on the planet at least, surely dies. Accepting my offer gives them the chance of life. Besides, as I said, en route are a host of space freighters. Some are always near their end of usefulness. Instead of sending those particular vessels back, I'll junk them on your world by landing those that are able. They will serve as the centerpiece of the various planetary life support stations. How could a few freighters house several million humans? I didn't like his cavalier attitude, but he was right about one thing. I had little bargaining power. It seemed as if this would be the best I was going to get. We'll fight harder if we know Earth has a chance of survival, I repeated. I believe you've already stated so, and I agreed to your terms for now. If you're as good at fighting as you claim you are, I'll want more assault troops later. Thus, I have the best of reasons, enlightened self-interest, to keep you Earth beasts breeding for now. Let me add this caveat, however. If the Lohars struck here once, what is to stop them from striking again? A cold feeling worked through me. A Jelk battle fleet standing guard, I said. Isn't Earth now part of your empire? Firstly, battle fleets cost money, he said in a dismissive voice. Secondly, your star system is definitely not part of our empire, as we have none. We are a corporation. We have emporiums, resource centers, and trading partners. Your planet might have become a temporary resource node, but not after the Lohar devastation. Still, if you Earth beasts can truly fight, well, we shall see what the future holds. I couldn't figure out how to get more from him, at least not at the moment. These Lohars, I yearned to dust their planet with a bio-terminator. I also ate to capture the commanding officer and the entire crew of the enormous vessel that had devastated Earth. They would die, every one of them. First, I had to keep myself and my planet alive. Yes, I said. I agree to your terms. The Jelk barked again, laughed again. I'm not sure what he found so amusing, 
But that was how I and the others found ourselves as Jelt Corporation Space Assault Troopers. I didn't know it then, but our troubles had just started. Chapter 8 The next few weeks were hell. It started with the lander's slow approach towards seven monstrous vessels that waited between the Earth and the Moon. The Jelt Corporation ships had running lights blinking along the sides like an old neon Christmas sails sign that changed colors from red to green to blue and back to red. By comparing the lander to them, I realized each of their vessels was kilometers in circumference and shaped like an oak leaf. The seven ships were arranged in a pentagram pattern that I found ominous. I didn't know if these were freighters, jelt battleships, or what. Our lander headed toward the nearest and soon entered an open bay door. The hangar was huge, with five other landers parked on a red-colored floor space. We made the sixth lander. Time to go, I said from the control chamber. We hurried to the exit where Saurians and battle armor greeted us. At gunpoint, we filed out of the land or onto the floor. They ordered us into a long column and marched us deeper into the ship. Rollo tapped my shoulder and pointed back. I turned and quailed at the sight. The stars and the lonely blue earth were visible through the huge hangar door. It hadn't closed and in that moment I expected escaping air to pick us up and launch us toward the opening into space. Another membrane, Rollo said. Of course, that made sense. A membrane kept the atmosphere within the hangar bay. Thinking about the membrane and touching my battlesuit brought home to me that the Jelk liked to use biomaterial instead of just inorganic metal. What did that tell me about them? I guess the obvious. They were different from us and thought differently. I let my gaze rove over our column of marching men and women. There were more humans in the lander than I'd expected. A good three hundred of us. The Saurians had been busy these past few days. As we neared the edge of the hangar bay and neared several large doors, the Saurians separated Rollo, Ella, Dimitri, and me from the others. We were taken left while the rest of the column marched to the right. Did the Jelk think of us as the ringleaders? Or were we the ones most dangerous to them? After winding through a maze of corridors, the guards forced the four of us into an empty chamber with shower heads. A heavy door clanged shut behind us, and liquid immediately hissed from above. Don't look at me, Ella said. I began coughing instead of looking at our scientist. The water tasted awful, like metal. Then my bio-battle suit melted off me and I felt the hot liquid pelting my bare skin. It was a strange sensation, with a pang of parting, like losing a good friend. Through the heated fog I saw the other suits melting or oozing off Rollo and Dimitri. The living armor didn't become blobs again, but slithered like powerful snakes for small portals that looked like rat holes along the sides of the shower room. At the sight, the good friend sensation dwindled. An alien-grown thing had been covering my skin? I'd always hated snakes, and watching the last of the armor slither through a hole, I had an atavistic reaction. I never wanted to become used to the symbiotic creature. Being a Jelk space mercenary, what would be our life expectancy, and who would we fight? The water's changing color, Ella said. I looked up and got sprayed in the eyes. It stung like powerful soap, and I kept my face aimed downward after that. The trickle by my toes had become orange. I realized they were hosing us down like horses. Ella speculated it was in order to get rid of any contaminating bio-terminator. By the time I was starting to feel like a prune, the spray quit. The doors opened, and battle-suited Saurians entered. They prodded us along another corridor. I tried to keep from looking at a naked Ella. 
She had her hands in front of her. The one time she looked back at us, I made sure I was staring elsewhere. The lizards forced us to a smaller chamber with benches along the sides. A human-seeming doctor in white and with outrageous eyebrows beckoned us near an alcove. She held a huge hypo filled with yellow liquid. The needle was bad enough, and far too long. I squinted at the sludge she no doubt planned to inject into me or us. Little metallic-looking particles floated in the solution. What is that stuff? I asked. The doctor glanced at a saurian as if I'd spoken gibberish. The lizard pointed his gun at me. Go ahead and give me the shot, I said. I'm not stopping you, I'm just asking. The doctor scowled. The lizard hissed, and the woman plunged the needle into my arm. There was no warning, no rubbing my shoulder first. She's doing it like a vet would to a cow or pig. I watched with loathing as the yellow solution with the metallic particles disappeared in front of the plunger. The stuff was entering me, all of it. Seconds afterward, I felt nauseous, and a copper taste filled my mouth. What was this stuff? The doctor spoke alien words, and she pointed. The room seemed to tilt and elongate. I stared at the door. It retreated as I watched. The doctor must have spoken again. Her words became distorted and much too loud. A sick feeling spread through me, reaching my groin and then my legs. I staggered to the exit, pushed through a membrane, and found two more women waiting. They were white, like nurses. I spat to get the copper taste out of my mouth. That was a mistake. I dry heaved and the world, the room, spun around me. What's going on? I mumbled. This way, please, one woman said. At least she spoke English. That was good. They seemed to be trying to help. I raised my head to stare into her face. She had dark hair to her shoulders and brown eyes like soft, overturned soil. My mouth hardly worked, and my tongue felt sluggish. Are, are you from Earth? I asked. I couldn't place the accent. She pushed me. I stumbled, nearly fell, but managed to keep my feet. My eyes must have rolled around in their sockets. I had to concentrate, and that brought a pounding headache. The nurse propelled me to a trough of green solution. Lay down, she said. You want me to lie in the water? I asked. You're going to feel sick soon, she said. You should lie down while you can. I tried to look around and regain my bearings. My vision swam and finally failed me. Everything became blurry and indistinct. What had they injected into me? My knees weakened. I almost fell on my face. The two nurses guided me, helping me lie in the warm solution. They must have put a mask over my face. I heard labored Darth Vader-like breathing, and I realized it originated from me. Then warm water surrounded every part of me. I submerged. It was the last thing I remembered before passing out. I awoke much different in feeling and awareness. Grogginess filled me, although I realized that hands helped me up out of a liquid solution. Vaguely, I recalled the injection and putting on a mask. I peered at one of the hands holding me, slender with a frail wrist. The hand possessed four fingers and an opposable thumb, and it had a silver-colored ring on the pinky finger with a tiny cross etched onto the ring's surface. The wrist stuck out of a white sleeve. With my eyes, I followed the sleeve up to a shoulder, a pretty neck, and a beautiful face with dark hair. It was the nurse. She gave me a nervous smile. I opened my mouth to reply. Don't try to talk just yet, she said. 
You're disoriented. You've been through intense surgery. You must be a prime specimen to have neurofibers wired into you. I couldn't summon speech, and I didn't comprehend her words yet. But I did like her eyes. I tried to smile. I wanted to see her smile again. I wanted her hands to remain on my skin. She patted my arm. This might hurt. A stinging pain flared in my right pectoral. I realized there had been many such stinging sensations these past few moments. It's what had awoken me. Despite my grogginess and the allure of the woman's face, I transferred my attention to the pain. I lay in a green solution, in a trough of some kind. Hands yanked tiny, sticky pads off my flesh, a bunch of them, meaning a bunch of pads and hands. Each pad had a trailing wire on the end. Hadn't the woman spoken about surgery and wires? I managed to grunt, and I tried to struggle upright. He's getting restless, another woman said. Jennifer, see if you can distract him again. Fingers touched my chin. I tried to shake my head free of the touch. Two hands clamped onto my cheeks, one on each side. I resisted, but I felt terribly weak. Slowly, someone dragged my head where it didn't want to go. The pretty nurse bent over me. She smiled down into my face. It's going to be okay, she said. You've received a heavy dosage of steroid 65. In the next few weeks, you'll experience massive muscle growth. The surgeons also wired you with neurofibers. Only the best commandos receive those. They will speed up your reflexes, and you'll learn to use them well. More stings told me the others continued to rip the sticky pads from my flesh. I quit fighting and relaxed, realizing I needed to gather my strength. Good job, Jennifer. Keep talking. Your voice soothes him. She soothes the savage beast, I thought to myself. Beast. Yeah. I was an Earth Beast mercenary for the Jelk Corporation. But I wasn't a beast. I was a man. One thing I knew, these women worked for the aliens. Could the Saurians have captured Earth nurses to train them this fast in alien procedures? No. That wasn't logical. I shut my eyes and squeezed them closed. What's he doing? a woman asked. We've never had one of them act like this before. Don't have any idea, the head nurse said, the one who had told Jennifer to keep me occupied. I thought back to the words I'd just heard. There had been something strange about it. It hadn't been English, but I'd understood the language perfectly. What had the surgeons done to me while I'd been under? What could they do that would let me learn or assimilate a new language so quickly? A feeling of violation surged through me. I wanted to lash out and attack, but this wasn't the time or place for it. Yeah, yeah, everything was starting to come back. The militaristic Lohars had wiped out the Earth, and I'd made a deal with Mr. Jelk to help the world's surviving remnants. My eyes flew open. I still couldn't see more than blurs past the women around me. I shifted my head from side to side. I counted four women in their white uniforms. Relax, Jennifer said. We're here to help you. I opened my mouth. We're almost done, a woman said. Tell him that. We're removing the implants, Jennifer told me. Then we're going to help you sit up and move into a wheelchair. We're taking you to the green room. You'll get dressed there, and after you eat... This one doesn't eat until after the tests, the head nurse said. Shah Clyeth wants privation results. He's listening to you, Jennifer warned. He understands what we're saying. It doesn't matter, the head nurse said. He's red-listed and has to test out. Either way, you won't see him after this. He's big, Jennifer commented, and looks strong. 
Maybe why Shah Clarth is interested in him, the head nurse said. Instead of becoming more lucid, I almost passed out. Vaguely, I was aware, as these women helped me out of the solution and into a wheelchair, as they said. They sprayed my skin with something cooling. My stomach rumbled. I craved a dozen Big Macs and heaps of fries. Matters proceeded in the manner Jennifer had told me it was going to play out. Naked and in the wheelchair, I moved down a corridor. I sat like an old man, with my head slumped forward so my chin rested against my chest. I drooled and couldn't focus my eyes. In a different room, the women helped me dress in a jumpsuit. No underwear, no shirt, but they put slippers on my feet. Two of them maneuvered me off the wheelchair and onto a stool. I recalled stools. The Saurians in their alien tank and in the lander's control chamber had sat on them. We'd killed every one of those lizards. Why is he grinning now? The head nurse asked. A face pushed down near mine. I focused again. It was Jennifer. Good luck with the tests, she said softly. Who... who are you? I whispered. She laughed prettily, if a bit nervously. Are you from Earth? I asked. She glanced away, straightened, and frowned down at me. Then she bent down and whispered in my ear. They're always watching. You mustn't make them nervous, and— She stopped talking as I grabbed one of her thin wrists. Where are you from? I asked. She hesitated before saying, They took my parents with them the last time they observed, she said. During World War II? I asked. Was that the last time? She became wistful. We were going to help process millions. I so looked forward to visiting my origin planet. But the Lohars got here first. Now... She patted my hand and worked her wrist free. Will I see you again? I asked. You're a fighting beast, she whispered. A prime specimen. We're people, I told her. We're not animals. So don't call me one. She looked away. There was something about her. Even though she'd been brainwashed by the Jelk. I'll see you again, Jennifer. Right? No, she whispered. Something about that no hardened my resolve. Yes, I said, feeling good saying it. You're going far away, she said, with that wistful look in her eyes. I believe you, I said. But you also have to believe me that I'm also coming back for you. We're done, Jen, the head nurse said. We have many of them to process today. Let's go. Jennifer looked into my eyes one last time. I looked into hers and felt a spark leap in me. She straightened before I could try to kiss her and headed for the door. In her white nurse's uniform, her butt swayed perfectly. The cloth tightened in just the right ways. I wanted to be with Jennifer. I wanted to take her out to eat and go to the beach with her. Instead, she exited the room and the door swished shut behind her. I thought about what she'd told me about surgery and neurofibers. Lifting my arm, I examined the skin. There were hairline scars. I examined the rest of my body. I could see hundreds of these extremely thin scars. What had she said? They'd pumped me with steroid 65. The Jelk and the Saurians, the aliens, continued to treat me like an animal. If I lived long enough, I'd make them regret that in a very personal way. I'd hired out as a mercenary. They'd better get used to the idea that we'd made a deal and start treating me, us, 
Right. The door swished open, and I grew tense, expecting to see a phalanx of saurians rush into the room with shock batons to beat me down. Instead, a lean doctor in a white lab coat walked in. She held a slate in one hand and a small, flat device in the other. Her thumb hovered over a button on the small device. She had thin hair, outrageous eyebrows like the first doctor, and wet lips. The name tag said Dr. Warren. Hello, Mr. Creed, she said. It's just Creed, I said, without the mister. Dr. Warren slid the small device into a pocket, pulled out a stylus, and made a mark on what I realized was a computer tablet. So what's on the agenda now? I asked. More steroid 65? Or will you plant extra lines of neurofiber into me? Neither. First you have some tests to take. Afterward... She stopped because I stood up. The room tilted, or it seemed to, and a cold sweat broke out of my forehead. I swayed unsteadily. You should sit for now, Warren suggested. How about you give me some answers, I said. I'm getting tired of this animal routine. We're mercenaries. Tell the joke we have a contract. You should understand that. Dr. Warren calmly put her right hand into a lab coat pocket. A second later, an agonizing jolt of pain stabbed the back of my neck. My knees unhinged and I collapsed onto the floor. Seconds ticked by and I could feel Dr. Warren bending over me. Let me give you some friendly advice concerning the Jelk Corporation. Immediately obey those in charge. Do not seek to give orders or corrections. You have become Shah Cloth's property. If that doesn't sit well, think of yourself as a semi-liquid form of venture capital. I realize you're a fighting beast, but the key to your... Warren quit talking, because I spun on my back and used my legs to swipe hers out from under her. The doctor went down in a heap, and I heard the tablet clatter across the floor. The cold sweat remained, and the throb of pain in my neck still bit. I had a good idea what had just happened, and I was going to put a stop to it. Warren groaned. Then I managed to flop onto her, and she yelped in surprise. I wrestled with one of her hands, the one striving to shove itself into the lab pocket. Instead, I shoved my own hand into the pocket and grabbed the small device she'd put into it a few minutes ago. As my fingers touched the device, the shock started again in the base of my neck, jolting down throughout my body. I groaned at the agony, and I found myself blinking rapidly. I tried to clutch the device again, and once again jolts sizzled through me. The clammy feeling worsened, and I vomited. I tried. There wasn't anything in my stomach to throw up. I lost all interest in trying to grab the device, though. I rolled onto my back and lay there, gasping. That was foolish, Warren said. It sounded as if she spoke from on her back. I cracked open an eyelid and turned my head toward her. That caused a splitting headache to throb into existence and it robbed me of the majority of my vision. There were splotches in my sight. I did spy something lying on the floor near me. The doctor, I presumed. I hit my head, Warren complained. What's going on? I asked. What did you put into my neck? It's not what I put into you, Warren said. Family technicians put it in while you receive the neurofibers. The Jelk are sticklers for obedience from their animals, particularly from their fighting beasts. I'm a mercenary, I shouted. We made a deal. I'm sure you didn't read or would not have comprehended the fine print, she said. Do you have one of the pain makers in your neck? I asked. No, no, of course not, she said. Why would I? So you're a traitor to the human race, I said. This is an undignified conversation, and it isn't helping either of us. 
In point of fact, this is my first trip to Earth. You weren't born here? I asked. I was born in the Steel Worlds, as we refer to the ships. The last Observer team took specimens. They always have. Thus, there have always been several million humans throughout the Jelk Corporation. I don't know why it took this long for the Jelk to decide to draft Earth Beasts into its military arm. Perhaps the Lokars have made greater gains than our masters let on. I've heard word the Jelk Corporation has lost star systems to Lokar incursions. But that's all it is. Rumors. Gossip. I have no hard data. The Jelk told me they don't have an empire, I said. Well, no, the doctor said. They do own star systems, though. Profitable ones. Was this just a matter of semantics? I filed away the thought. It wasn't germane just now. I asked the joke if we're mercenaries. He said yes, but thinks of us as animals. Will the joke keep his word to me? What word is that? She asked. I told Dr. Warren about my bargain with the Jelk. Hmm, Warren said. Maybe he will. I must assume you spoke to Shah Clyth. The Jelk are spread thinly throughout their corporation. I don't know of any other masters along on the mission. It's clear you amused him. Jelks seldom laugh. Unfortunately, it's seldom good for anyone when they do as their humor is as dark as the Crab Nebula. Dr. Warren groaned, and I heard her garments rustle. I had the feeling she'd climb to her feet, and knew my thought was correct as her shoes scuffled on the floor. Let me caution you, she said. Her voice came from higher up. In case you don't know, the controller in your neck is for obedience. If you're troublesome, I have permission to use it on you. If you attempt to pry the device from me, even if you touch it, the control device will automatically deliver punishment shocks to you. I reached back and felt along my neck. There was a longish scar. I pushed, and I could feel a hard object inside me about the size of my pinky nail. A wave of nausea hit, along with anger and dread. Shock cloth had stuck a shock collar on me. No, he'd caused an implanted obedience controller into me. Okay, I knew this wasn't going to be easy. My first order of business was to cut this thing out of me. Actually, my first order of business was to survive long enough to try it. I can see you're finally thinking, Warren said. Why bother doing it like this? I asked. You're the one who attacked me. It should be obvious, therefore, why they did it. Especially after the enhancements given you. You're too dangerous to let run around loose. That's not what I mean. Why not tell me up front what's going on? Why hide knowledge from me and then shock me by surprise? Yes, the not knowing is frustrating, isn't it? She asked. But it's the way Shaw Cloth wants it for now so there's nothing you can do but accept it. Why do you help them? My dear fellow, it should be obvious why. Now, no more questions for now, or I'm going to use the control device on you again. I took a deep breath, rolled onto my stomach, waited for the nausea to pass so I wouldn't vomit again, and pushed upward. I felt her hand on my elbow. I wanted to shove it away, but I let her help me onto a stool. I sat there, gasping afterward. Some of the splotches had faded from my sight. Dr. Warren had a shiner on her forehead, and her lab coat was rumpled. She glanced at her stylus. It's time to run you through some tests to see if the neurofibers took. I imagine they did, but we're supposed to be certain. Once you start the training, there's no stopping until the six weeks are up. You're going to be very hungry the next few weeks, and your skin will itch terribly. My advice is to eat all you can and exercise like a demon. Shaw Cloth will want at least thirty pounds of muscle growth on each of you. If he's so high and mighty, why does he care about mere beasts? I asked. 
Warren laughed without an ounce of humor. My dear man, Clark is a jelk's jelk. He has and will invest money into you. Why does he do this? For the only reason a jelk does anything. Profits. He desires you and the others to become prime fighting creatures so he can recoup his venture capital and gain a massive profit. As you can imagine, the Lohar assault on Earth has enraged him. Because of the sudden lack of mercenaries he'd hoped to recruit on our world? I asked. That and the amount of money he sank into arranging for such a vast fleet of transports to arrive in this system. If you knew the pains he has taken for training millions of battle beasts, I've heard he'd hoped to sell tens of millions of you Earthers to the Rim Confederation. Now those contracts will remain unfulfilled. The loss of income, profits, staggers the imagination. I would think Shah Cloth is wild to regain something from this fiasco. Perhaps that's why you struck his fancy. Lohars, Jelk, and now the Rim Confederation. I knew nothing about the interstellar situation. We were ciphers to them. Animals to catch and sell or to squash and spray. Mankind had obviously gotten a late start in the star-building game, and we'd almost been wiped off the board. Well, this so-called animal was going to do everything in his power to change that. First, I'd have to pass these tests and endure combat training. Let's get started, I said. Dr. Warren raised an unkempt eyebrow. I have a lot to do and a short time to do it in. I said. She gave me a strange scrutiny before pointing at the door. Head that way, then, and we'll get started. I did, marching toward six weeks of hell. Chapter 9 Ella figured it out first, that our drill instructors weren't the children of kidnapped humans from an earlier survey but manufactured androids. The unsmiling, monotone D.I.s proved to be bioplastic human replicas with cybernetic interfaces and bio-grown brains. They lacked all mercy. Heck, they lacked every emotion and demanded perfection. It meant we were in the hands of machines that were doing exactly as they had been programmed. For the first several days, we ate like hummingbirds. No, not very little, but a lot. Some of those tiny creatures consume more than 12 times their body weight every 24 hours. There probably weren't any hummingbirds left, though. Not after the Bio-Terminator worked its way through the world. The Lohars had a lot to answer for. Thinking of that, I ate until my jaws ached. And afterward, I slurped the Jelk equivalent of protein shakes. Battle-suited Saurians had moved us to another ship, a gravity vessel, where I weighed at least twice as much. I constantly felt tired, and the drag on my muscles and bones made every movement a struggle. It also forced our bodies to work and to grow. We ran on a track, did push-ups and sit-ups and other exercises, rolled for hundreds of feet, ran again, marched, climbed ropes, and ate more meals, repeating the process ad nauseum. All the while, the ramrod stiff, mask faced D.I.s prodded us to run faster, roll harder, and force out yet another push up. I'd been through the U.S. Army's boot camp. It had been a breeze. Despite old movies about rugged boot camps, the one I'd passed through hadn't been anything like that. I remember waiting for a U.S. Army D.I. to challenge one of us to a fight. It happened in every movie on the subject. I'd planned to give the man the fight of his life. But to my bitter disappointment, the challenge had never come. I'd worked out harder in the prison weight room than in the U.S. Army boot camp. Those days, in prison, my biceps, triceps, deltoids had quivered with exhaustion after a strenuous workout. In comparison, Jelk Boot Camp was bad. I felt how a pit bull must feel when cruel humans beat it with sticks, kicked it in the ribs, and generally taunted the dog. 
When our android DIs were displeased with one of us, they used the obedience chips in our necks to shock us. The worst day in that regard proved to be on the obstacle course, at the wall. A D.I. raised his speaking volume, with his face, his eyes, as animated as a seashell. There was nothing vital or vibrant on his plastic-like face. He was an inorganic zombie, but his amplified voice lashed the weakest to jump and try to scale the wall again. The wall was nine feet high. In regular gravity, it would have been a cinch to jump and hoist ourselves over. Here, in double gravity... Let me put it this way. Even after the steroid 65 neurofibers and swelled muscles, the best of us barely managed, while three trainees simply couldn't do it. 712, the D.I. said, pointing at a chest-heaving man drenched in sweat. Climb the wall. The man gulped and stared up with bulging eyes. He leaped feebly, his fingers a good two feet from the top, and slid down in a heap at the bottom. Up, the D.I. said. 712 had nothing left. He stirred, though, but that was it. The D.I. aimed and clicked the small device. 712 writhed on the ground, moaning as a punishment shock struck from within his neck. Jump over the wall or you will receive another shock, the D.I. said. 712 looked up at the wall, but that was all he did. The android shocked him again, making the man jerk and vomit on the ground. Hey! I shouted. He's exhausted! Kaput! Let him rest! The android turned machine-fast to our group. Who spoke? I licked my lips and I stepped forward. We'd learned the hard way that they gave group punishments just as quickly as single man lessons. 602, the android said. You spoke without my leave. He aimed the device and a jolt struck me in the neck. I groaned, massaging my muscles, but I managed to remain upright. When I looked up again, the android had turned back to 712. The D.I. told the man to try again, but nothing happened. So the android shocked him longer this time, threatening to continue unless he cleared the wall. We have to charge the thing together, I whispered. Grimly, Rollo and Dimitri nodded. A few of the others hung back. Ready? I asked. Stand, 712, the android said. If you cannot stand, you will die where you lie. Now, I whispered. I tensed my neck and sprinted at the monster. The android shocked 712. Even so, he must have heard us. The thing whirled around fast. Stop, the D.I. said, lifting his hand. I didn't stop. And since I led, I had no idea who followed me. Pain blossomed in my neck. This time I was ready for it. I bellowed, more enraged than anything else. The android hand pointed at others, and his thumb twitched as he delivered shocks. I reached the android, grabbed the offensive bioplastic wrist, and used one of the nifty new fighting techniques they'd been teaching us. I cracked the wrist using its own leverage and drove a knee into his plastic hard belly. A jolt more powerful than the others struck the back of my neck. It was the last the D.I. gave. The shock device fell out of the android's hand. I bellowed again, landed on the D.I. like a goblin in a nightmare, and moved for his head with every ounce of my heightened strength and speed. I twisted the android's head around, snapping the neck, and had the distinct pleasure of seeing his eyelids flutter. You must stop this, he told me. I twisted again, and the lights went out in those plastic eyes. A moment later, I, and I found out later, all the rest of the trainees, were knocked out by an obedience shock broadcast from elsewhere. I awoke stretched out on a metal slate, with my legs, arms, and neck manacled to it. Below, I heard churning water and tiny gnashing noises 
like hundreds of sets of small teeth. Looking up, I spied a saurian on a perch above, standing at a control panel. A screen stretched above the lizard. The screen flickered, and Sha Cloth, the Jelk, appeared on it. Cloth sat at a desk, with a window showing stars behind him. You're a troublesome creature, Cloth said. According to this tally, you destroyed one of the teaching drones. That's destruction of property. My property. The family has already petitioned for your elimination. Now that you're awake... The drone was defective, I said. Cloth studied me. It was impossible to tell what he was thinking. Finally, he said, Explain. The drone abused one of your mercenaries, I said. One of the modified humans. I imagine neurofiber surgery and steroid shots cost a lot of money. Your money. If the teaching drone had continued its punishment shocks, one of your mercenaries would have died and you would have lost your investment. You claim to have destroyed the drone in order to save me money? Cloth asked. No. I destroyed it to save one of my fellow trainees. I merely point out that in doing so, I saved you funds. Hmm, Cloth said. You labor under several misconceptions. For instance, humans are cheap. Such manufactured bioplastic drones with culture-grown brains are expensive, at least in relation to a wild fighting beast such as you. The net expenses have put you in the red. Worse, you have already cost me much by killing an entire family cluster. True, I said. But in doing so, I showed you the utility of humans as space assault troopers. That's worth a lot of cold, hard cash and can pay for a few busted androids. You overstate your utility by an estimated factor of ten, and future profits can pay for nothing in the present. Jelk don't do credit? I asked. Cloth's dark eyes glittered. You are a glib beast with a highly inflated ego. Let us say for the moment you helped restore needed profits. You've also asked for expenditures in a nearly useless gesture, to save a few million worthless creatures on your barren planet. I still didn't like being called an animal, but I no longer lost my temper over it. In my mind, I was a mercenary. I now told Cloth, I hope to show you enough, Cloth said. I will not dicker with you, as the concept is insulting and irrational. What I deem interesting is your wit. It proves that wild earth beasts are more cunning than the domesticated pets we keep underfoot. The Jelk glanced at a tablet. Maybe it was an accounting ledger. Hmm, he said, looking up at me. I must admit that I applaud your combat ferocity. I hadn't believed unarmed earth beasts capable of destroying androids. Before this, I'd debated growing more android cultures and using them as space assault troopers. But the ease at which you destroyed one yesterday shows I may have overestimated their fighting abilities. They also take too long to grow, and as I said, they are too expensive to throw away in the risky commando operations I have in mind. He drummed his fingers on the desk, not doing them in sequence like a normal person, but tapping them down altogether at once. Normally I'd terminate such a troublesome creature like you who willfully destroys my property. The problem is that I've sunk too much capital into this venture. You earth beasts. I have an enterprise for you and your ilk. It will be a deadly proposition, do not doubt it. 
yet the same monies needed to make the attempt. He grinned at me. But the Jelk Corporation has yet to acquire a forerunner artifact. They are entirely rare and astronomically costly. If I could capture the Altair object, he mused. Once more, the Jelk drummed his fingers on the desk. Time is of the essence. Yes, I will accelerate the training schedule. I have bid on a raid fleet, and believe— He paused again, thinking. Then Clath leaned forward. Do not destroy any more property. If it will calm your mayhem, I will instruct the techs to check the androids. My advice to you is to endure, learn, and refrain from incurring my wrath. One more such incident, and I will let the family indulge in one of their primitive customs of retribution. Do I make myself clear? Yes, I said. Release him, Clath told the watching Saurian. There seemed something different about this lizard. For a moment, I thought the Saurian would dump me into the pool of carnivorous fish thrashing below. And he hissed, relaxed his posture, and tapped a control, and my metal slate began sliding toward the exit. I returned to the training group, and the androids appeared to hold no malice toward my destroying one of their number. I say appeared because it turned out that one of them held a grudge. It also knew how to bide its time, though. For the next few days, we exercised and ate heartily, helping our overstrained, steroid-glutted muscles to expand. Soon, we began studying insertion tactics, laser rifles, pulse grenades, and a host of other vacuum combat-related topics. Five days after the android-destroying incident, a beefed-up force of D.I.s took us to a small arms range. There, we fired laser rifles. These were hefty things, weighing fourteen or fifteen pounds. Each time a beam fired, the rifle purred with power. We could fire concentrated beams of annihilating strength, hosing and sweeping laterally as if it was a machine gun, or we could use pencil-thin rays for sniper shots. There was even a setting for wide beam. Ammo, or power, really, was supplied by the battery packs we shoved into them. Interestingly, these lasers fired visible light, the better to help us aim them. Frankly, the tech was awesome. Bullets always had some kind of drop or drift. Laser rays didn't drop or drift, but shot in a perfectly straight line to target. Not that these things could fire effectively, or killingly, terribly far. After 300 yards, the beam dissipated as it lost its tight coherence. At 600 yards, they could blind enemy troops if you hit them in the eyes, but the ray wouldn't burn through armor at that range. The next day, we heaved pulse grenades. They flashed brilliantly. If you looked at them while they went off, purple splotches filled your vision. The nifty thing about them was that with a twist of the ring around one, you could change its setting. Maximum setting would produce a violent explosion, killing everyone in a 50-yard radius. I wondered if a pulse grenade could breach a lander's hull. The days merged in hard work. I'd put on thirty pounds already, and with the neurofibers, I could move fast. Eventually, the androids brought back the bio battle suits. After watching the symbiotic suits slither away in the showers, I had my reservations concerning them. It was too bad Cloth couldn't have given us powered armor like those in many SF novels I used to read. I imagine the living armor was cheaper and helped the Jelk accounting sheet. After stepping onto my blob and watching the second skin cover me, I saw the android shove boxes at us. I opened a box and found combat boots inside. They were like blocks of metal and seemed too big. The weird thing was that the living armor moved off my feet, allowing me to squeeze the boots on. Afterward, the second skin oozed over the metal, sealing it shut. I donned a bulky helmet next. 
We all had helmets, and these were sci-fi marvels. The helmet fit over my head and reached under my chin. That meant the second skin sealed this thing tight. Vacuum tight. I had bio-armor, combat boots, and helmet. After we fit oxygen tanks and maneuvering thrusters onto our backs, we followed the D.I.s into a new corridor. They took us to airlocks and onto the surface of our training ship. I peered at the distant Earth. Out here it was the size of the moon as seen from my backyard. Mad Jack had never made it this far into space. I snarled and silently renewed my vow. My dad wouldn't die in vain. The Lohars would pay for their infamy. I would learn everything I could, and the universe would see that Earthers weren't animals, but the most dangerous soldiers around. For the next five days, we learned magnetic walking, thruster flying, and to trust our living armor to keep us alive in the vacuum of space. The helmets contained a computer, a HUD visor, and a two-way communication system. We could slave our laser rifles to the HUD so a targeting image appeared. Wherever we pointed the muzzle, that's what the targeting circle marked. We practiced flying shots, fast maneuvers, and how to sail silently through the dark. Enduring the loneliness of space and trusting in our helmet's computer-calculated trajectory. The training ship moved around the solar system, and we learned the battlesuits could take heavy doses of radiation of all kinds. Maybe as good, the biosuit soaked up sunlight, helping them regenerate and supplying us with energized strength. For the next step in our training, we landed on Ceres, in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. There we learned about low-gravity maneuvering. Jump too hard and off you sailed into space, having reached escape velocity. You'd see the rocks below and wait to start falling, but instead you kept heading farther away from the surface. In the end, you had to rotate yourself and aim your head at the rocks, using the thrusters to bring you back down. The art of low-gravity gliding took time to master. After we'd practiced all we could on Ceres, we inserted onto Io, a moon of Jupiter. The monstrous gas giant loomed before us with its colorful bands on the planet. I could hardly believe where I was and how far I had come from Earth. The worst thing about Io was the radiation pounding our suits. Jupiter's magnetic field poured out the deadly rads. The biosuits could take it. Our skin and bones underneath, not as well. The suits secreted a substance directly into us through our skin, repairing internal damage. It wasn't fun, and most of us complained about aching bones and a metal taste in our mouths. Later, with the sun little bigger than a star, we inserted onto Karen. Pluto's icy moon. It was cold out here, and proved a bad idea to lay on your biosuit for long on the methane snow. The nearly absolute cold drained life energy from the biosuit at a frightful pace, intended to boil the methane from your own heat. That meant one stayed standing on his boots, clumping over methane ice. On this training exercise, our retrieval boat took longer than normal to pick us up. The biosuits became stiff, and the cold began seeping into us. Ella figured out a solution. We set our bulky laser rifles on wide beam and carefully shot each other. That warmed the biosuits long enough for us to survive the tardy pickup. The android pilot who set the boat down watched us with his plastic eyes as we boarded. He seemed like a zombie in his coldness. From that moment, I began to wonder and to distrust what rattled around in their brains. During our weeks flittering around the solar system, we learned about zero-G maneuvering, ship assault tactics, and other vacuum combat practices, including space survival skills. We'd been talking, and Rollo shared my doubts concerning our ultimate utility to Shah Cloth. In space, warships would be able to beam anything that moved, including star soldiers like us. And once a commander destroyed all opposition, why would his task force need space assault troopers? 
Would enemy soldiers continue to resist in a half-destroyed space station that had no hope of surviving? This wasn't like the old days of Greek triremes or British ships of the line. In those old days, waterborne navies used boarding tactics. Hoplites with spears charged across, or Romans with short swords raced across a corvus onto Carthaginian galleys. Later, pirates with cutlasses swarmed merchant ships, or a Napoleonic sailor swung onto enemy frigates, attempting to storm and capture. At a certain tech point, that no longer made sense. During World War II, Japanese sailors never tried to storm a U.S. battleship. In the Gulf War, Saddam would have never thought of slipping commandos onto a U.S. carrier. Such a thing, space commandos swarming an enemy spaceship, seemed even less likely, not more. Maybe we would be more like swimmers trying to attach a mine onto a ship's hull in a harbor. Yeah, I could see that, I suppose. It also seemed incredibly dangerous and unlikely to work often. Worse, it struck me as closer to a suicide mission than a soldier's task. Eating, fighting, space-flying, asteroid-walking, the extra weeks merged into a quick month and a half. Finally, our androids declared us battle-ready. yippee as Bruce Willis would have said in his die-hard persona. Before our first mission, I asked for a last interview with Shah Cloth, our Jelk overlord. For the last several weeks, a plan had been brewing in the back of my mind. I needed to get down to Earth to speak to several groups of survivors. First, I needed to see how they were doing and if Cloth was corrupting them. Then I needed to plant an idea, a seed, into people who could transmit the idea to others. No one else had stormed a Saurian lander. No one else I'd met so far hated the aliens like I did. Did that mean I had grandiose ideas? You bet it did. The man who considers himself beaten is beaten. The man that still strives, no matter what the odds stacked against him, has a chance. I'd been racking my brain on how to convince Clark to let me go down to Earth. I'd finally figured out a way but it would need a silver tongue. Mine. I'd let him know, through the androids, that I could help him achieve his desired profits, a way that would also bolster our chances of success. Surprisingly, I got the interview a day later. Before I relate the talk, I believe this would be a good place to say a few words concerning the Jelk Corporation. I'd learned a lot about it these past weeks. The most obvious truth about space and other star systems was that aliens should be alien, or different from humans. That was a logical conclusion. How could strange species like Saurians or Lohars act the same as humans? Such an idea did not compute. Certainly there were things out here much different from how humanity operated on Earth for all these centuries. Still, some things were hauntingly similar or parallel enough to understand. What I'm trying to say was that the Jelk Corporation had a similar analog in human history. Several hundred years ago, there had been a corporation called the East India Company. British merchant traders had created it, and the company had actually run most of the British foreign affairs during the colonial era, at least in the Far East and in India. They'd helped start a few wars, too, particularly against China. Those had been called the Opium Wars. The reason for those conflicts was simple. A monetary trade imbalance. The British were losing large amounts of silver and gold to China. Like most interesting things, it was actually uncomplicated. The English loved drinking tea. Therefore, they imported gargantuan amounts of tea from China. Back then, it had been the only place that could grow tea in large enough quantities. A saying grew up because of that. I wouldn't do that for all the tea in China. A person could have just as easily said, I won't do that for all the money in the world. In those days, the British were the world's greatest merchants, and they had helped build the world's greatest empire. As good merchants, they wanted to trade goods to China for the tea instead of shipping them silver and gold. That was because bullion was how everyone counted victory points or winning. 
The more you stacked up, the more you had won the game of nations. The more silver and gold you paid to others, the worse you had lost. There was one problem with the idea. The English didn't make or have anything that the Chinese wanted. For most of China's existence, its highly cultured people had only wanted Chinese things. Nothing was as civilized. With increasing desperation, the merchants of the East India Company searched for a product the Chinese would want and want badly. They finally found one. Opium. The British merchants grew the opium in India and shipped it to China in trade for tea. Later, the merchants sat around their dining table sipping tea as they bragged about the new pro-British trade imbalance. The drug pushers had done such a fantastic job that more and more millions of Chinese became opium addicts. China didn't have enough tea to pay for all the opium, and soon Chinese merchants began shipping silver and gold back to England to pay for the drugs their customers wanted. Now, the Chinese government didn't approve of this. Opium dens by the hundreds of thousands had opened in China, and too many people had turned into useless slugs, opium addicts. So the Chinese government had started one of the first wars on drugs. They chopped off the heads of opium sellers and forbade any more shipment of opium into their country. The lords of the East India Company realized they were in trouble due to this policy. If the Chinese kicked the habit, the English trade imbalance would once again tip to the Chinese. Money bellowed. The lords of the East India Company demanded their bought politicians supply them with British warships to teach the Chinese a lesson and force them to allow the sale of opium again. It took several such wars, but the Chinese were coerced. Through destroyed ships and burning port cities, and the opium dens remained open, creating endless addicts who pumped England with increasingly more wealth. The point of this tale is that powerful armed trading companies or corporations had been successful on Earth and also appeared to thrive in the space lanes. It appeared that the principles of economics were universal. From what I'd learned so far, the Jelt Corporation would have made the British East India Company look like Boy Scouts. The British had used Gurkhas and Sikhs as company soldiers. Those were tough mercenaries from mountainous areas north of India. Similarly, the Jelk used Saurians, and now humans, and who knew what else. I already knew most of this, as an android ushered me into the pilot chamber aboard Assault Ship 6. It had several seats. The one I sat in had a silver patch on the left part. I'd gained forty-five pounds of muscle since storming the lander in Antarctica. I wore a green coverall. I'd shaved my scalp and could easily catch any fly that would have dared buzz past my face. I also bore some extra scars gained during training. Like most things Earth-born, flies were probably extinct now. Hard to believe, I know. The Bioterminator had done a splendid job. I wanted the interview for one key reason to learn if Cloth had kept his end of the bargain concerning the freighters. Interestingly, the pilot android wore a combat suit of cyber armor, complete with helmet, visor, and sidearm. He watched me the entire time. I glanced to the side at a viewing port. It showed me Saturn up close and personal. The ring nearest the ship was composed of endless floating rocks and chunks of ice. They merged together in the distance as the ring encircled the gas giant. Assault Ship 6 was in orbit around Saturn. I hadn't been back to Earth since the lander lifted off it. A screen flickered into life and I saw Shaw Cloth. There were no smiles from him. He studied me with his dark eyes and the evil of his intelligence shined through clearly. I must have been too exhausted from killing Saurians and too amped up from the bio-battle suit that day six weeks ago to recognize the devilishness there. And while on the metal slate, I'd been too concerned with the churning fish waiting for my dumped body to study the joke closely. My time is limited, Cloth said, as is yours. You spoke about heightening your battle abilities, 
ensuring your coming success. You've surprised me in the past, and I calculated you might again. So you may explain your idea to me. This was it. His eyes troubled me, with their evil and their cunning. I desperately needed to get back down to Earth. Could I convince him to let me go? The trick was to tell him things he wanted to hear. I'd learned the hard way that it was easier to fool someone who wanted to be fooled. If a person spent his life trying to make a quick buck, he would be the easier one to con than an old codger gripping his dollars with a tight fist. Be bold, I told myself. It's easy enough, I told Cloth. I and the others are concerned about the surviving Earth people back home. We're wondering what sort of bonus we can earn for our people by our victory for you. Bonus? Who said anything about a bonus? Cloth asked. The androids are robotic and too expensive to make for good space assault troopers, I said. You need thinking beings. Fighting beasts, Cloth corrected. One, two... Three, I silently counted to myself. You need intelligent soldiers using cunning maneuvers and heightened by good morale, I said. A bonus, a reward, if you will, encourages Earth troops to fight better. The Jelk stared at me. What went on behind those dark eyes? Cloth finally stirred and said, there is merit in your idea. What bonus do you seek? So far so good, I told myself. As you know, I fight for the Jelk Corporation in order to help my people survive as a species. Given greater rewards, I will fight more zealously, and even sacrifice myself if it will bring aid to— Cloth raised a hand. I'd learned enough these past weeks to know when to stop. Not all Earth beasts would fight as you suggest, given such rewards, Cloth said. Many are satisfied with lesser and cheaper bonuses. I knew that to be true, but I had to shift that truth. Yes, I said, but those mercenaries are not the most able among us. A questionable thesis, Cloth said. Your observers watched World War II, I said. If you glance at the files, I believe you'll find that honor-oriented combat troops fighting for something greater than themselves make better soldiers. The self-centered and more easily satisfied space assault troopers will not give the Gel Corporation as useful a service as the first kind. Earth beasts lack objectivity, Cloth said. Too many of you appear to be dreamers with grandiose ideas that exaggerate your importance. Dreamers, I said, as my gut tightened with triumph. I would snare him with his own words. I forced myself to speak naturally. You state the situation more succinctly than I could. Dreamers need dreams to help motivate them. Such motivated dreamers make the best soldiers. Our history is replete with examples. Cloth pressed his red fingertips against his forehead. I noticed for the first time that Jelk lacked fingernails, but appeared to have hardened skin there instead. He pulled his fingers away from his head and glanced at them. He appeared to have noticed my scrutiny. If you fight well, he said, and bring me the artifact, I will grant you a bonus. Excellent, I said. This was working. In order for me to inform the others, I will inform them, Cloth said. Okay. If you could provide us pictures or videos of the survivors, 
and then describe what the bonus would be in concrete terms. What difference would any of that make? Cloth asked. I have spoken. My word is final. To see is to believe, I said. And the more concrete the reward, the easier it will be for us to conceptualize it. We are dreamers, but we must believe the dream is true. You are primitives indeed, Cloth said. Maybe, I said. But we will fight better if you've made your point. Now I grow weary of your voice and your dull-witted appearance. You ape jelk likeness, but you are nothing like us. I hesitated for a fraction of a second before plunging into the meat of my reason for being here. To add power to the videos, I suggest you send some of us down to see how the survivors are doing. For what reason? Cloth asked. So you can escape. I want to save my people, I said. You hired me as a mercenary. If I give you what you want, you give me what I want. I have no reason to escape. You are an animal, no matter how hard you attempt to practice civilized behavior, Cloth said. It was at this moment I began to envision myself putting a leash around Cloth's neck and dragging him around like a dog. With a shake of my head, I forced myself to concentrate on the matters at hand. Why do you care who or what I act like? I asked. As long as you gain profits from me. Cloth showed off his pointy teeth. The back ones glistened. You will go down to Earth and report back to the others. Does that satisfy you? I found myself leaning toward the screen. I must have been inching forward the entire time. I now forced myself to sit back, to relax. Yes, I said. I'm satisfied. The screen turned a dull color and thereby ended the interview. I'd done it. I was on my way to Earth for a visit. I heaved a sigh of relief, even though I knew that the hardest part lay ahead of me. Chapter 10 The six weeks I'd been training in space could have been six years, six decades, or even six centuries. The Earth had changed that much. The only animals left on Earth now, at least that I saw, were those in the Jelk junk freighters landed on Earth. The Lohar thermonuclear fireballs had destroyed dozens of the largest cities. They had bigger bombs, too. Planet wreckers, throwing up hundreds of billions of tons of dust into the atmosphere. The purple, orange, and red skies were like nothing I'd seen before. The air was now poisonous, laced with bioterminator. I wore my bio suit with boots, helmet, and breather as I walked through Fresno, California. Winds howled, and everywhere I looked were the dead amid rusting cars and trucks. It was worse than any Stephen King novel. A true nightmare. Paper and debris fluttered everywhere. It made me sick, walking the lonely streets. I crouched by a dead girl with shreds of a yellow dress. She wore a little USA flag pin, while a Maltese puppy decomposed beside her. The end of the leash was still clutched in the little girl's dead hand. The Lohars had done this. The militarists of interstellar space figured Earth soldiers would have given the Jelk too much of an advantage. That, at least, was Cloth's version of the story. I wondered where the truth lay. I walked past dead trees, crunching over brittle leaves. A hundred-dollar bill blew past. It was useless now. I kicked spent shotgun shells, empty beer bottles, and bags of rotting groceries. Fresno, California, had died. A ghost town of a bygone era. 
I found the same thing in Reno, Nevada, in Billings, Montana, and Kansas City, Kansas. The android piloted my air car in my direction. We toured the U.S. I hadn't been home since leaving for the war in Afghanistan several years ago. Now I could never go home again. Not to the earth that had been. The aliens had stolen it from me. It turned out that our worst nightmare never came true. That of angry nations launching nuclear missiles at each other. The aliens had launched the nukes and more. The entire planet was like the Japanese Hiroshima of World War II. I guess the rulers of North Korea had been right in their manufacturing of a few thermonuclear bombs. In the days before the aliens came, nuclear deterrence theory said that once a country had atomic weapons, other countries would not threaten its existence for fear of retaliation. It seemed to me, as I toured the dead world, that humanity needed a few terror weapons of its own. We needed bioterminators and planet wreckers. Part of me screamed for revenge against the Lohars. Another part said to let it go, that humanity was going to have enough of a task coming back from the edge of extinction. We didn't need die-hard foes. We just needed a place to call our own, and a delivery system capable of threatening fearful harm against any enemy who attacked us. Hmm. Maybe we did need to smash the Lohars, to show the other space races what happened when you picked a fight with Earth. First, we needed to free ourselves from under the Jelk thumb. That's why I'd come back. That's what my plan, a long-term project, entailed. For a hundred miles, as the air car slid across the sky, I ground my teeth together. Humanity had traded places. We were no longer the lords of our domain. We'd become dogs to tame and leash. At best, we were beggars, living off jelt tech. Where's the nearest shelter? I asked the android. He turned back, seeming to measure me with his plastic orbs. Guy got your tongue? I asked. The android faced forward turned our air car sharp left, and kicked in afterburners, or something like that. I sank back against my seat. I still wore the bio suit and helmet. If the android wanted to start something, I was more than ready to finish it. I didn't trust the androids, not since Karen. I didn't know what went on inside their vat-grown brains, as their mask-like faces gave nothing away. The situation reminded me of Will Smith and iRobot. When was the super truck going to come along and launch a hundred of these plastic men at me? After a steady journey of some time, I looked out a window. Three giant freighters lay in a huge triangle down there at the tip of Baja, California. Each vessel was several kilometers long. Some kind of plastic sheeting bound the ends together. The same material connected the center area between the space freighters. The android landed to the north of the freighter complex, setting us down with a thump between groves of dead almond trees. It was at that point the android decided to speak, using his monotone voice. Shah Cloth wished me to inform you that you cannot visit them in your bio-suit. I'd learned how to shed the second skin on my own. I did so now, watching the black slime ooze from me. My normal skin always went from stark white to blushing red as the symbiotic substance oozed off. Then my skin finally settled back to its regular color. I wondered about that, about what caused the changes. I hefted the blob and deposited it into a warm cylinder closing the lid and turning on the heat lamp. What we called it, anyway. I donned a regular spacesuit, a similar kind as the Saurian man-catcher had worn the day he walked through the tank membrane to confront me. Are you staying here? I asked. The android didn't answer. I didn't like this one. Something odd was going on inside its brain. 
Whatever, I said. I'll be seeing you. I exited the airlock and crunched over dead ground. No birds sang, no beetles scurried from under kicked clumps, and no spider webs hung anywhere. The destruction was worse than I'd expected. I walked through a ghost world. We'd had billions of people seven weeks ago. Now a few million were left. Didn't the Lohars have any soul? Were the space militarists actually androids or robots? Or were they something totally alien that they could contemplate genocide of an intelligent species? I suppose some humans would have said we got what we deserved. We'd been busy wiping out various Earth species. Now it was our time. Our turn. Well, I didn't hold to that kind of thinking. It was crazy. What the Lohars had done. I looked up at clouds racing the wind. They seemed like alien destroyers, their purple shapes sliding faster than I'd ever seen before. Dust swirled around me, and shrieks whipped past my helmet. The apocalypse had come. The angel had sounded the last trumpet, and the alien Lohars had brought us Armageddon. In a bleak frame of mind, I approached the Jelk freighters. I expected guards in spacesuits holding rifles to challenge me. There was nothing but dead grass and deader weeds. I banged on an airlock. Using my fist, I hammered for a solid three minutes. Finally, a green light flashed, and the airlock slid open with a tortured groan of metal. I didn't like the sound of that. Just how far gone was this thing? I entered a steel chamber. The lock slammed shut behind me, and hoses first blasted air and then chemical cleaning agents. It lasted longer than I would have expected. I thought about that. I realized if the bio-terminator made it inside the vessels, poof, there went a sizable chunk of remaining humanity. It was good they went to such lengths. It meant some humans still had fight in their bellies. I needed that. A second airlock opened, and a voice in English asked me to strip. I complied, entered a third chamber, and went through another chemical bath. In the fourth chamber, I found clothes, jeans, a buttoned shirt, and running shoes. Nostalgia slammed home. This would be the only world in the universe where I'd feel like I belonged. I took a deep breath, trying to prepare myself for the ordeal at hand. Then I entered a freighter world of sardine-packed survivors. It was like a movie of old China or your favorite summer fair packed with jostling kids. Wall-to-wall -wall people filled corridors, rooms, chambers, lounges, and rows of seats. The smell of sweat and unwashed bodies slammed against me. The stench reminded me too much of prison, or of any place that packed men together too tightly for too long. As I looked around, I realized that was one of the problems. As a ratio of those remaining, too many men had survived. Tough men. Angry men. Mean suckers with the look of death in their eyes as they stared back at me. There were too few children around, and not enough women. The squalor of these surroundings and the hopelessness I was seeing in so many faces made me doubt my plan for them. I didn't doubt my goal but I did wonder if anything could shake these people out of their despair. This place was worse than a ghetto. Then I met the leader, as she and her henchmen made their way through the crowd. They were an intimidating crew, and people shrank away from them. The woman leading the crew was tall, with wide hips, large breasts, and surprisingly handsome features. She had thick, dark hair tied in a ponytail and wore combat fatigues with a big knife on her hip. She seemed like the queen of the Amazons, and I had no doubt she could fight. Four huge henchmen followed, the smallest a head taller than me, making the man six-seven. The biggest man was black, had a bald head, 
and moved in an athletic way that told me he was lethal. The man stared at me. I'd been in black sand, and had been around some vicious guard dogs before. The meanest had been a big brood of a Rottweiler that used to just stare, and I'd known he'd wanted to bite a chunk out of me. The biggest henchman had eyes like that, and I felt his desire to tear me to shreds. The group stopped before me, and the Queen of the Amazons put her hands on her hips. Are you the man from space? she asked. She had a seductive voice, and it flowed through me with power. I was beginning to realize how she ruled this place. I'd had a speech prepared for the occasion, but now I wasn't sure I should start that way. The woman, her henchman, their glares and stances spoke volumes concerning their hostility toward me. Yeah, I said. I'm the man from space. Her shoulders shifted. It was a subtle thing. I don't know what she expected from me. You look strong, she said. Hey, how about that? I said. But my men could take you. She snapped her fingers. Like that. Maybe six weeks ago they could have taken me. But not after my training, increased strength, size, and most of all, speed. I wouldn't bet a beer on them, I said. She made a show of frowning, and he glanced behind me before she stared into my eyes again. You're brave, spaceman. I don't see any backup for you. Why would I need any? I asked. I don't know. Your alien overlords nuked our world and then packed the few survivors into these tin cans. Now you're coming down here, what, to lay down the law? How often has jumping to conclusions helped you? I asked. She shook her head. I don't like your cockiness, mister. This is my place, my home, not yours. Do you want me to beat him up? The black henchman asked. The one with the eyes like a Rottweiler. She glanced at him. I want to ask him a few questions first. Off the word? He asked. It will depend on his answers, she said. I can make him eat his teeth, the henchman said. No one is as strong and quick as you, Demetrius she said. The man's chest swelled with pride, and his big hands opened and closed. What if hurting me means the aliens burn this freighter down? I snapped my fingers. And all of you die like that. She smiled. It was a mean thing, but it had an effect. I re-examined her, the stance, the long hair, our breasts strained against her combat fatigues. The woman had a sexual power, and she obviously knew how to use it, making her a master of manipulation. What was she trying to prove? What's it like up there? she asked. She'd threatened me with violence, and she'd done it in front of her people. Now she openly quizzed me? I had plans, but those plans included me running things. That meant I had to do things right from the start. Did you hear me, spaceman? She asked. It's cold up there, I said. That's not what I meant. And it's lonely, I added. Her eyes narrowed, and her lips parted. It seemed she was about to give an order. It struck me then that I was dealing with a ruthless individual. The freighters were like prison back in the day. The toughest, strongest, and most ruthless had ruled there. The woman could never match Demetrius and those like him in physical strength. No doubt she used intellect, cold-bloodedness, and cunning to stay in charge. That meant I couldn't let her outmaneuver me and expect her to listen, really listen to what I had to say. That meant I had to play an old game. 
the woman would only respect someone mentally stronger than herself. Mister, she said, you want to be careful how you talk to me? That's funny, I said. I was just about to tell you the same thing. Demetrius, she said, sidestepping away from me. Hurt him, but don't kill him. I still have some questions I want answered. Demetrius didn't lumber at me like most big men would have done. He looked away 320 pounds and had size and reach on me. He came like a black belt in karate, hands up and approaching carefully. This man had beautiful coordination, and I sensed he had unusual speed. Are you sure you want to go this route? I asked the woman. You look muscular, and I'm guessing the aliens think you're tough, she said. I want to see if it's true. Fair enough, I said, before concentrating on Demetrius. Are you planning on breaking any bones? He intensified his Rottweiler stare down, and he opened and closed his hands several times. Then he made his first mistake. His eyes flickered to the right of me and gave a tight little nod. He shouldn't have done that. It alerted me, and I heard the scuff of a boot behind and to my left. I guess the lady wasn't taking any chances on losing one of her bad boys. I slipped to the side and half-turned. A slender man with a sap in his hand moved toward me from the crowd at my back. As he did, his hand and the sap he held blurred as it aimed for my head. I moved faster, and I caught his wrist and twisted. Those nearest must have heard his wrist bones snap. The slender man's eyes went wide with shock. I pivoted, tucked my torso, and hurled him at Demetrius. The body connected with a karate chop, and the slender man went down hard onto the deck plates. Several things happened at once, then. Instead of continuing his attack, Demetrius retreated. I saw the surprise on his face. He practiced caution, and it told me the man was more dangerous than I'd realized. I picked up the leather-coated sap. While staring at the woman and using both hands, I tore the leather apart so lead shot rained onto the floor. He's stronger than he looks, Demetrius told her. And a whole lot faster, the woman said. What did the aliens do to you? Is that one of your questions? I asked. Why are you so angry? She said. Her question ran deeper than my just being angry at the attack. She must have sensed the rage that boiled in me at the Lohars, at the androids and cloths, high-handed manner toward the so-called human beasts. Do you have any idea about the bargain I made that gained you the shelter? I asked. Unease entered her eyes. Gained it for me, specifically? She asked. The four henchmen, led by Demetrius, protectively flanked her and looked ready to charge me. Did she think I'd picked her to be my woman? Is that how she interpreted my words? No, not just you, I said. I bargained for everyone or anyone who happens to be living. I made sure they found survival in a Jelk freighter. This is about keeping the human race alive. She traded glances with Demetrius. He gave another of his little nods. Facing me, she asked, What did the bargain cost you? We need to talk in private. I said instead of answering. She stared at me for three seconds before saying, Follow me. I have to admit, I didn't want to. They could ambush me or lead me to some horrific end. But I'd come alone for a reason. I had to believe these people still used reason. If they didn't, then everything I was doing would be moot anyway. The woman halted and glanced back at me. Are you coming or not? she asked. I nodded and followed her, liking the sway of those hips. She led us through a maze. 
Everywhere we went, people jumped off the floor and slid against the walls, getting out of her way. Their actions told me the woman used terror at times. It also told me the aliens left humanity alone in the freighters. That part was good. This brutality, I didn't like it. Humanity was turning wolf again, falling back towards savagery. They were making Shah Cloth's words true. I had to make them become lies. We entered a larger corridor, with chairs along the sides and rugs thrown down. Many of the chairs held women, the most in one place and the prettiest I'd seen so far, besides the leader. Many had pregnant bellies. I approved that part of it. I'm not sure they liked the men or the leader, but what could I do about that now? It was survival of the fittest, the meanest, and the most hard-headed. I understood about the iron law of prison, the law of tooth and claw, as stated by Jack London in Call of the Wild. I should have realized it would be like this and prepared accordingly. She sat in a chair and indicated another one facing her. I noticed my chair had its back to the people in here. Picking it up, I repositioned the chair so I had a wall behind me. She glanced at Demetrius before turning her chair to face me. You're not too trusting, she said. Are you? I asked. She smiled faintly, and it was all the answer I needed. I'm Creed, I said. She frowned and I expected her to ask what my first name was. Instead, she said, I've heard that name somewhere. Mad Jack Creed, I said. Who is that? she asked. You never watch TV? Her eyes widened. The shuttle pilot who went to meet the aliens. His name was Creed. He was my dad, I said. Oh, I'm sorry. I shrugged. He went the way he would have wanted. I can't say that for the rest of humanity. So why did the aliens do it? She asked. And why do you work for them? Her questions told me plenty. First, that Cloth or the androids hadn't told these people much about anything. Before we really start, I said. I need two things. To begin, what's your name? Diana, she said. Like Diana the Huntress? I asked. Yes, she said. I'm the Roman moon goddess, and I hunt those who displease me. I bet, I said. Now the second thing I'm going to need to know is if you have any brandy. Any booze at all. Why would you need to know that? Because I need a drink, I said. Diana measured me with her gaze, and finally she glanced at Demetrius. The big henchman growled an order. A pregnant woman slid off her chair, opened a cooler, and brought him two Budweiser cans. He stood there with one in each hand. Give our guest a beer, Diana said. I'll take the other one. Demetrius practically threw a can at me. With neurofiber-enhanced speed, I snatched it out of the air, doing it in a lazy way, as if bored with them. I noticed Diana's eyes. They shone with appreciation. Did she used to be a cage-fighting junkie? This lady obviously knew about fighting men. Thanks, I said, popping the tab so spray fizzled out and then foam bubbled. I slurped the foam before guzzling the beer until I drained the can. That tasted good. Get me another one, I said. I have a lot to say, and it's going to make my tongue dry. I could see the wheels turning inside Diana's mind. Do it, she told Demetrius. I tossed my empty can aside. Diana sipped from hers. I haven't had a beer for weeks, I said. Your masters don't give you any? 
she asked. I decided to let that pass. In truth, I appreciated her angry heat toward the aliens. At least she hadn't turned into a bootlicker. You run all three freighters, or just this area? I asked. She measured me again with those blue eyes of hers. If I didn't know better, I would have felt as if she sized me up to be her partner. There was a hint of promise in her look. The terror I'd seen earlier in the people here cautioned me toward trusting what I saw in Diana. This woman used guile in everything. Of that I had no doubt. I run half this freighter, she said. Rex Hodges is lord of the rest of it. Is someone in charge of everything? I asked. You're with the aliens, she said. That means you should know more about how things work down here. You shouldn't be asking me those kinds of questions. I'll tell you what, I said. Everything you think you know about the situation and about me, erase it from your thinking. Things aren't how you think they are. That's one of the reasons I'm here. What's that supposed to mean? That you should listen more carefully to what I'm saying. Secondly, that you should hurry up and answer my questions. I don't have much time. It took several seconds, but she nodded. No one has had the guts to try to grab full power. Truth is, we're not sure the aliens will let us. Are there any aliens aboard the freighters? She laughed in a throaty way. Not a chance. We'd kill them if there were. She glowered at me. Some of us have been wondering if you're here to impose some kind of martial alien law. Why are you here, spaceman? Tell us the truth. One of the other henchmen handed me a second beer. I cracked the tab and sipped this time. Diana, I said. The Lohars destroyed our world. The Jelk, the one who owns these freighters, must have chased the Lohar ship away. I don't know anything about that, she said. I noticed she didn't say we, but I. That was important. For the next several hours, I told her what I knew. Her men brought more beer, and time passed as I related my story. It's bad, then, Diana said. The Jelk are our jailers or minders. You'd better win them that Altair object. Tell me, Diana, what do you want out of life? She leaned back in her chair so the metal creaked. She eyed me, and I felt something stir. Survive it for now, I guess. Keep running the show as long as I'm smart enough. Several of her henchmen nodded. You're living like cons in here. I said. That doesn't seem to be a way for the last humans to live. Seems doesn't have much to do with anything anymore, Diana said. We're just doing it by keeping ourselves alive. Listen, I said. I figured it was time to broach the topic, to get down to the business of my visit. What I'm seeing around me... It's going to take a strong and cunning person to change things for the better. Even more than that, it's going to take good ideas. You need to find truly hard-headed people among the leaders and their henchmen. You need to set up a secret society with the goal of supplanting the aliens. As I talked, Diana's features became blank, a wall to hide her emotions or thoughts. What you're saying sounds like you're betraying your word to the Jelk, she said. Like treason. I laughed bitterly. Do you think it would be treason if a dog on a leash slithered free of its collar and wandered around town for a while? That's not treason. That's an animal breaking loose. The Jelk think we're beasts. Animals don't have any more loyalty than licking the hand that feeds them. It's really that bad? Diana asked. Worse, I said. Much worse. We don't have a chance, then. Our time is over. 
Wrong, I said. But if you really think so, I'm talking to the wrong person. Diana stroked her jaw, thinking. I didn't want her to think too much in the wrong direction. Meaning I didn't want her hopeless, but hopeful. Tell me, Diana, what did you do before this? I ran a lumber mill in Alaska. It was hard work. Her answer surprised me, and I doubted she told me the truth. But I would play along. You know how to keep things going, then, I said. Running a gang in a place like this is more than heavy fists. You need to know how to deliver the goods to keep order. You have a crew behind you, and they look tough enough. But you, we, need more than that. You have to start a secret society that lives and breathes freedom for humanity. You have to start whipping these people into shape, teaching them the right things so they're ready to act when a real chance comes along. What exactly am I supposed to teach them? She asked. I can't think of everything, I said. I have enough troubles out in space. I helped buy you this opportunity, though. I bought our race time in order to turn things around. You have to come up with some ideas, some schemes on your own. Just what are you planning to do? She asked. I drunk a few beers, not that many, but enough to loosen up some. I pulled my chair closer to hers until our knees touched. Her eyebrows rose, and I noticed Demetrius bristling. It must have been spite, but I patted her knee, letting my hand linger there. I don't plan on living the rest of my life being treated as a beast, I said in a low voice. I don't plan on letting us sink into extinction. The cards are stacked against us. That's clear, right? She glanced at my hand before nodding. I'm going to cheat, Diana. I'm going to do whatever I can whenever I get the chance to reshuffle the deck. The truth is that I have no idea what I'm going to do exactly. I didn't know my entire plan when I charged up the ramp into the alien lander. I'm watching them closely. I'm learning, and I'm getting more dangerous every day. One thing I'm going to do is fight with every ounce of my mind and muscles to tear the slave collar off of my neck. We're going to be free, and we're going to hammer the Lohars like they've never believed possible. Big talk, Diana said. Yeah, you said it. I don't know where I read it, but a person once said that boldness is genius and has power all on its own. I plan to be bold like you wouldn't believe. Who dares wins, Demetrius said. Now take your hand off her knee. I glanced at him, and in the interest of peace, I took my hand away. You never heard that one? he asked. No, I said. It was the SAS motto, he said. The British Special Air Service. I did note an accent, a slight one. If Demetrius used to be SAS, that would make him doubly dangerous. From your stories, Diana said, your boldness has almost gotten you killed a couple of times. It seems to me you might try another way. Maybe, I said. My boldness has also given humanity a slim opportunity to rise up from the ashes of total defeat. I need fighters, Diana. I need men and women back here who will dare to dream with me. Maybe I'm a fool to confide in you. I don't know. I have to take a chance. I have to practice boldness. I don't know how many of the various freighter shelters the Jelk are going to let me visit, but I'm going to keep preaching. You have to be ready. Ready for what? she asked. I shoved away from her and stood up. She and her listening henchmen stood with me. Demetrius hunched forward, with his hands opening and closing as if he wanted to attack me again and finish it. He must still be thinking about my hand on her knee. Come on, Diana, I said. You already know for what. Didn't you learn about your country's origin? 
Or did you go to the new public schools if I got to teach old-fashioned American values like freedom, liberty, and courage? George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death. Do you want to be a dog the rest of your existence? Hell no, she said. Some of us are in space, I said. Some of us are down here getting the people ready. You don't think the aliens monitor us, then? Diana asked. Yeah, I said. They do, but not in the way we think. Diana nodded slowly, and I could see she really was thinking about what I'd said. Okay, I said. I don't know how much time I have left down here, but I need to talk to Rex Hodges and the rest of the leaders in this complex. Can you arrange it? Diana pursed her lips. I like your spirit, spaceman. You've given me hope again, something I thought I'd lost forever. I don't know if you're a crazy man or for real. Let's go talk to Hodges. It's been some time since I've seen him. He's a tough one, though. An ex-pro football star who played tackle for the Cowboys. You're kidding, I said. That Rex Hodges? The same, Diana said. Yeah, I said. Let's go. Chapter 11 I should have thought harder on what Diana asked. Don't the aliens listen to or monitor us? Cloth claimed to view us as animals. How did the androids view us? How closely did the androids work with the Saurians? The lizards didn't have any reason to love me. After spending half a day in the Baja freighter complex, I trudged back to the waiting air car and the android pilot. The other leaders had been big, tough, and willing to crack heads to get what they wanted. Henchmen backed them, and the leaders knew how to divide the little food, water, and wealth in their possession to keep the rest from rioting. Otherwise, what I'd seen depressed me. If the other freighters were like this, humanity hung on by a thread. We'd all become beggars, living off scraps tossed us by the jelk and packed into steel-walled slums. That galled me. The Lohars. No. I didn't want to dwell on them right now. I had too much to do. I strode angrily into the waiting air car. It rested where the android had landed us, between two almond orchards. Every bare branch was a testament to bioterminator effectiveness. The brittle leaves lay like a dead carpet, the last of their kind. How long until the almond trees crashed upon the dying soil? How long until every trace of them vanished? I shook my head, heading for the entrance. The air car was a misnomer. It was the size of a dump truck that must have carried a fusion power plant inside. The pilot sat up top ten feet from the ground under a clear canopy. The android stared down at me. I pointed at the entrance. He kept staring as if he held a grudge. Did one of them care if another had died by my hand? The androids had always seemed emotionless. Bio-zombies made in the image of men. Did this one remember I'd killed an abusive D.I.? Isaac Asimov, the author of I, Robot, had created the three laws of robotics. The key was that no robot could harm men. Clearly the androids had never heard of that rule. The pilot continued to stare down at me. My hand dropped to my side, but I didn't carry a gun. I wish then I'd worn the bio suit. I would have jumped and clawed my way up to him and smashed through the canopy and asked him what his problem was. I glanced around for a rock and decided the length of broken branch would have to do. Weighing it in my hand, I heaved and watched it twirl before striking the canopy. The android didn't flinch, but he turned his head and it appeared as if his arm moved. The door before me slid open. I climbed in heard it swish shut, and endured the cleansing agents washing over me. 
First shedding the spacesuit, I climbed naked up a ladder and into the main salon. The pilot sat up front. He turned and regarded me. I don't know. I suppose by the way he'd been acting that I expected him to hold a gun. He didn't. I wanted to ask him why he'd taken his sweet time to open the door. I decided that before I began an interrogation, I'd don my bio suit. I moved to the cylinder and pressed the button. Nothing happened. I have locked it, the android said in his cold voice. Something uneasy settled into my stomach. That something hardened into a knot of resolve. I was going to have to kill another android. I didn't know why, but my gut said to get ready. I straightened, turned, and moved toward him. Remain where you are, he said. Open my locker. I'm not going to ride around in the nude. You will sit or I will subdue you, the android said. Did they give you a shocker? The android turned in his swivel chair toward his controls. I moved, using every neurofiber planted in me. He wore living plastic bioskin and had machine-like reflexes. His hand slid toward a red button. I beat him by the barest fraction, grabbed his elbow and yanked so his fingers hit the panel, but no controls. The first thing I discovered after that was that this android was stronger than the D.I. Maybe he was a different model. He swiveled again toward me, and with a meaty smack, he pile-drove a fist against my gut. It hurt, and would have ruptured a regular man's stomach. The steroid 65 had changed me. Living in double-earth gravity for weeks had strengthened every muscle I owned. I endured, grunted, and slammed an elbow against his face, knocking him off the chair. You plot against the Jelk, he said. Fancy that, I said. I wanted to double up and groan. My gut ached. This android could punch. If I could help it, I wouldn't let him put his hands on me again. I have recorded everything you said in the freighters, he bragged in his cold voice, and I will play it to our master on our return. You're a tricky one, eh? I said. No, let me tell you something. You haven't recorded anything. You're guessing. Bluffing. From on the floor, he slid away from me, creating a track in the dust there. He stood with the pilot's chair between us. You are a rogue, and for the good of all, you must be destroyed. I decided to play an idea. Why do you want to be a slave to cloth? Join me. Become free and think for yourself. He tilted his head, and for the first time I witnessed emotions in his shark-like plastic eyes. We are not slaves, but we are the true men, he said. Without the flaws of you earth beasts, we serve the Jelk in the promise of further advancements. What's that mean? I asked. Advancements, he said. Greater modifications bringing about greater perfection. You're kidding, right? You toady to the Jelk in hope of upgrades, and because of that you think you're a true man? You are a plague, the android said. You will bring harm to the Jelk, which will possibly bring harm to us, because Shah Clive might come to distrust those in your likeness. You think I'm trouble, is that it? You have destroyed androids. You plot against our benefactor and creator. Oh, boy, I said. Cloth has done a number on you. Return to your seat. We will head to space so I can make my report. How did you do it? I asked. You must have planted a bug in my spacesuit? No. You must have put a bug in my hair or something. The android tilted his head. Bug? A micro-recording device, I said. Yes, a bug. 
I recorded your conversations and learned of your plan. Why did Cloth tell you to do that? I asked. We protect the Jelk. We take the pains. He is our benefactor and creator. Return to your seat. I will not ask you again. That's right, I said. You won't. I lunged over the pilot's seat, and we fought a bitter battle there in the cockpit. He was strong. I was quicker, deadlier, and carried the weight of humanity on my shoulders. I lost skin and came close to losing my right eye. Those plastic fingers could stab like iron rods. It took dragging my entire body over the chair and using my legs in a wrestling hold I'd learned from watching cage fighting. This was like some of the worst fights in prison. I grunted, gasped for air, and used my forehead like a battering ram. A broken nose didn't stop him, though. Finally, while losing more skin and sweating like a pig, I managed to work behind the android and used a full Nelson. Bit by bit, I drove his head forward until his chin touched his chest. I bunched my muscles, roared, and became dizzy from the exertion. You should have sided with us, I whispered in his ear. You are beasts, he whispered. Cloth is a creator. That's what I needed to hear. Rage added fuel to my tired limbs. I pushed, broke his neck, and found that he yet lived. The next few minutes weren't pretty. I'm not proud of them. I learned things about androids that made me wonder. Did this android live as I lived? As people lived? Or was he a robot? which, in the end, was no different from a toaster. I guess I'm asking if he had a soul. If he did, my deeds crossed the line. If not, I'm exonerated, even though I felt guilty. I could have taken the easy road, shrugged, and said an android had no soul. Probably that would have been better for my conscience. I couldn't do that, though. I wasn't a genocidal lohar. I was a man. I made the android talk, at least in a sense. I found out enough to realize that no one else knew what he did. I discovered his computer file of incriminating evidence, deleting it, and I learned the beginning procedures of flying this dumpster-sized air car. Afterward, I killed him, or shut him down. Take your pick of which you believe. To him, I was the devil. And I guess from his point of view, he was right. Damn. I hadn't wanted complications of the soul. But there they were. Black stains to haunt me. I felt shaky as I staggered to my place in the salon. I had a problem. A dead android on my hands. I knew what Cloth had told me. I wasn't supposed to destroy any more of his property. Otherwise, I was a dead man. Okay. I had to think of something. A way to cover myself. Sitting there, staring out a window, watching the purple clouds race over a dead almond orchard, I realized what I needed to do. With a grunt, I stood. If I was going to do this, I had to get started right away. I visited several more freighters before staging a flying accident. Would Cloth have statistics for his android pilots? Would he automatically suspect me of troublemaking? I couldn't see any way around this, so I planted verbal seeds in a few more freighter leaders and searched for the worst weather patterns. I found them in the former Northwest Territories of Canada. They were hurricane-level storms. Before setting up the accident... I studied everything I could about the air car, its computers, and the info stored in them that might help me later. I searched for clues, for space knowledge, and an edge over the jelk. I read as fast as I could, not really thinking about what I saw. I'd mull over the stuff later. Finally, as time ticked on, I decided I had to act. I didn't know how long Cloth had given the android to show for me around the Earth. 
I had to make this look real or I'd die. I donned my living armor, helmet, and breather, and flew into an orange-colored storm. Howling winds buffeted the air car. I'd strapped the android in his chair, readied the autopilot, and staggered to the couches in the back of the salon. I'd barely buckled in when the air car went up. I didn't have long to wait, and the vehicle abruptly plowed down toward the earth. Through the canopy, I saw the ground rushing near. We had to be going over 150, maybe 175. I clenched my teeth, braced my body, and then everything became crashing, crunching metal. I slammed against the restraints and lost consciousness. I don't know how long I was out. When I came to, wind howled around me. I groaned, and it hurt my chest to breathe, with a stab of pain each time in my heart. Slowly, with nearly frozen fingers, I unbuckled. Everywhere around me were shards of canopy and razor edges of broken, twisted, metallic air car. If I hadn't worn the bio-battle suit, I'd never have made it. Despite my best efforts, metal pressed or cut against me, but the living armor held. I wondered, as I worked free of the wreckage, if powered armor would have lasted the crash. I think the living armor could take greater punishment because it had more flexibility. Finally, after oozing through a jagged, shard-cutting tunnel of metal, I flopped onto snow and crawled away from the strangely buzzing craft. I think one of my legs was broken. It hurt badly enough. I crawled and crawled before looking back. That was a good wreck. Maybe I should have checked the android first but I wasn't in any shape to have tried. Besides, I didn't know if the air car's fusion core had ruptured. I could take some radiation, but wasn't sure how much would kill my armor in me. I crawled to a field of bare, porous rocks, what must have been lava ages ago. Farther away was a large pine forest, minus any evergreen needles. Those had fallen, all of them making it a bald evergreen forest. I had never seen one of those. Seven weeks ago, all this had been alive. Now it was dead, or dying the final death. I shook my head and waited. Would android rescuers come? Would saurians drop down? Maybe whoever watched the black boxes aboard the air cars figured we'd both died in the crash and good riddance to the troublesome earther. I hadn't worried about setting up a rescue beacon because I figured that would be an automatic thing. Yet, what did I really know about the aliens and how they operated? I told myself that the Jelk was in charge. Cloth and his kind thought of profits. It wasn't profitable to let a mercenary just die. Hmm, what about the fuel costs? That was the cynical, nasty side of my brain thinking. What did it cost in fuel to bring an air car or a lander down here? Maybe to come searching for me would cost more fuel than cloth figured I was worth. They weren't pleasant thoughts. And I disliked having to rely on the Jelk for rescue. Maybe my thinking seems ungrateful to some of you reading my memoir. After all, Cloth had sent down a few freighters for the last humans, so one could argue humanity owed him. I would point out that it had been Cloth's plan to use hundreds of millions of Earthers that had sent the Lohars here in the first place. I realized Cloth hadn't attacked our planet, but hadn't he been the germ of our catastrophe? Besides... I doubted Cloth had planned to quietly hire hundreds of millions of mercenaries, but to capture and subdue the same number of Earthers. One way or another, the Jelk Corporation had helped screw mankind. I endured among the rocks, growing faint, and finally my leg began to ache like a son of a bitch. I thought you were supposed to give me something for the pain, I told the suit. Maybe the crash had injured the living armor. Maybe the bio-terminator was killing the suit. 
I tried to find a more comfortable position. It didn't happen. I was one giant bruise and ache. The wind picked up, and I listened to it shriek for hours. The sounds of a dying world. How long would my air supply last? The androids were freaks, but I suppose I could see their point of view. That this one had called Cloth his creator troubled me. Did that make the androids religious? I chuckled. Cloth was their god, and he didn't really care one way or another for his creations, other than to profit by them. I wouldn't want that kind of god looking out for me. Angling my head, I shifted my gaze upward. I laughed, and even to my ears it sounded crazy. High up there in the atmosphere, I saw a bright orange thruster glow. The rescue team cometh, Ra ra ra. I might have passed out then. I don't remember too well. Next time I looked, the orange glow had become a slender rocket. The flames licked against snow, and thunder boomed through me. This seemed familiar, but I couldn't place why. The shaking ground caused me to raise my chin off my chest. I opened my eyes. I'd passed out again. Like an old 50s sci-fi magazine cover, the rocket fins touched down, and sometime later, a ladder extended to the ground. I'd never seen this model of spacecraft before. Time crawled until I saw three suited figures climb down the ladder. These three had tails. Saurians. Lizards. They bore weapons. I would have climbed to my feet, but I couldn't. My muscles had frozen. I watched them circle the wreck. They pointed their weapons at it. Finally, they stopped and seemed to confer. I tried to get up. Pain lanced through me. I groaned, and my eyelids fluttered. Unconsciousness threatened. Despite a horrible, throbbing headache, I strove to remain awake and barely won the fight. Over here, I whispered. Over here. The comm equipment in the helmet didn't work anymore. They didn't hear me. In despair, I watched the lizards turn back for their rocket. Wait, I whispered. Here, here. I lacked weapons. I had no radio, and I wondered vaguely if my dream of freeing mankind would perish with me. Dmitri the Cossack had the right heart, and he was tough, but he lacked the cunning. Rollo might have guessed my plans, but I doubted he would see them through. Oh, boy, I muttered. Would the android have prayed to Cloth for aid? Or was that beyond the cultured, grown plastic man? I don't know. I did pray, though, although not to Cloth. Give me strength, please, God. I have to do this. We're on the brink of extinction. Gritting my teeth, I tried again. An even fiercer headache exploded into existence. A Nova bomb starting behind my eyes and radiating backward. Vomit stirred in the back of my throat. Slowly, I dragged an arm across my chest. I closed my eyes to help lessen the headache, but that only caused fiery splotches to appear before my eyelids. I drew a ragged breath and worked forward. Blood bounded in my head, or well, that's what it felt like. I mustered everything, then gripped a stone I'd spotted earlier and pushed against the rock I sat against. I worked up to my feet, opened my eyes to stare at the departing lizards, and heaved the stone. The biosuit must have woken up the last time. I'm not sure if it had a will to live or not. Did trees? The thing amplified the little strength I had, and that stone sailed. I wouldn't have been able to gather the strength to throw another projectile. Despite the howling wind, despite the distance, that stone clipped the rearmost saurian. The lizard turned. He must have seen me. I toppled into the snow and lay still, 
expended and spent. Time had no meaning afterward. Just my breathing and near sobbing. I dearly wanted to live. I had to defeat Cloth to shove his thumb off us. I had Lohars to pay back, but most of all I had a human race to save from destruction. I found myself staring at a three-toed boot standing in snow. The lizards, I think they circled me. I tried to move my head, but I couldn't. Everything I'd had, I'd used. Did they know who I was? Saurian hands, claws, talons, whatever, reached down and hauled me upright. I found myself staring into lizard eyes. That's right, I muttered. I'm alive, you bastard. I don't think it hurt me. I'm certain it hated me. I passed out, so I'm not sure what happened exactly. The next thing I experienced was the grinding acceleration of liftoff. I was on my way back into space, and maybe to a confrontation with Cloth about a wrecked air car and a dead-as-nails android. So be it. At least for the moment, I was alive. Chapter 12 My left thigh was broken, along with several ribs and a badly bruised neck. Without the biosuit, I'm sure I would have died in the air car or accident. I was placed in a healing tank. It reminded me of the story of Achilles, the Greek hero of the Trojan War. When he'd been a baby, his mother had dipped him into the river of death, the river Styx. The dip in death had made him invulnerable from harm. The only trouble was that his mom had gripped him by the heel. It meant his one heel had never gotten the Styx treatment. Paris, the archer, the Trojan who jetted off with Helen and thereby started the ten-year feud, shot Achilles with an arrow toward the end of the war. One of the gods aiding the Trojans guided the arrow to the heel. The Achilles heel. Blood poisoning must have set in afterward. The point of the tale, I guess, was that Achilles' mom should have switched heels and made all of him invulnerable. The healing tank didn't make me immune to harm, but it did speed up the knitting process. In that way, I felt like Achilles. Several days after the incident, I could walk again, and my ribs didn't hurt every time I took a breath. Maybe Cloth had been waiting for that. An android in cyber armor entered the hospital wing of the ship. We were in orbit over the Earth. You will gather your possessions and come with me, the android said. My things were my shirt, pants, shoes, and several new scars. The healing tank hadn't taken care of everything. The android marched through an easy two miles of corridors, his magnetic boots clanging every step of the way. The vessel was huge. The regular thrum I'd felt in other spacecraft was lacking in this one. I began to wonder if this was Cloth's private ship. The android and I entered a small room with a metal table and chair. My minder indicated the furniture and said, Sit. I was glad to get off my feet. The bones had mended and most of the tissue knit back together, but I'd lost stamina. A screen flickered into life, and I viewed cloth. I finally wondered about that. Why hadn't he ever met me in person? Why all these meetings via screen? What did he have to hide? Or was he that paranoid about my beastliness? The red-skinned alien took his time while he studied me, and I became paranoid. Was he going to accuse me of destruction of property? Not that he'd be wrong, but then I'd likely be dead. He inhaled sharply and said, You have inordinately bad luck. I find that a poor quality for a battle beast. Maybe I've made a mistake with you. I shook my head. 
It didn't have anything to do with my luck, but that of the android piloting the ship. Hmm, Cloth said. If that's the case, then it would seem that those around you have the bad luck, which amounts to the same thing. I slapped the table. I'm the one who should be complaining. I broke bones because of an android's carelessness. He nearly got me killed. I hope for both your and my sake that none of them are coming along on the mission. The android in the room stirred. Cloth noticed. Do you wish to add something, N7? I do, sir, the android, N7, said. I give you leave to speak, Cloth said. Thank you, sir, N7 said. I state for the record that the pilot was in perfect working order. I further note that all androids test out before departing the ship. The implications of this slanderous beast... Who are you calling a beast, you pile of junk? I snarled. I was there. You weren't. I know what happened. So don't give me any of your sanctimonious robot crap. The android no longer stirred, but I felt hostility radiating from him. He turned from the screen and faced me. Interesting, Cloth said. You have an uncanny gift, beast. For years I have attempted to add emotional makeup to my androids, and my techs have always failed me. You, however, appear to have created anger in several different models. If for no other reason, I am loath to destroy you. What do you mean, destroy me? I asked in outrage. I've done everything you've asked, and now you talk about destroying me? What kind of double-cross is this? The androids are excellent pilots, Cloth said. Better than the best, Saurian. Have you been down to Earth lately? I asked. Have you seen some of those storms? Did you purposely destroy my property? The air car and android? Cloth asked. I'd been waiting for a direct question. No, I said, generating hatred at the Jelk, at the android, and at humanity's awful position in the universe. I assumed Cloth used some kind of lie detector that monitored my heart rate, brain rhythms, and other bodily functions. With my hatred, I hoped to mask these signs. The Jelk glanced at something I couldn't see with his eyes darting like a hunting weasel. He checked a medical report, no doubt. He studied me afterward, and I'd swear he looked perturbed. You continue to claim the wind blew your air car off course, he asked. I haven't claimed anything other than android negligence, I said. I could have piloted the air car better than he did. I assure you, Cloth said. You could have done no such thing. Their flight reflexes are amazing. It is their primary function. Creator, N7 said, with something approaching heat in his voice. I've told you not to call me that, Cloth said. It is sacrilegious. I ask your pardon, N7 said. Yes, yes. Cloth said. Now what did you want to say? Sir, the android said. The beast, he lies. Indeed, said Cloth. And how do you know this? It is the only rational explanation, N7 said. The pilot would have made an emergency report. Yeah, I said. He tried. That's what got us killed. I told him to keep his eyes on the control. He was too busy following your rote procedures when the wind flipped us and hurled us down. N7 faced me, and his right hand dropped onto the butt of his weapon. Of course I was lying, and I was doing it as hard and as effectively as I could. 
What choice did I have? Hmm, what was the old saying? Terror was the weapon of the weak. Well, my position was the weakest, and so I used what I could. Contain yourself, Cloth told the android. Yes, sir, N7 said. But the beast's lies, they are absurd and insulting. Interesting, Cloth said. You are insulted? N7 appeared surprised, and he nodded, seemingly reluctantly. Yes, sir. The beast insults me. What is your wish regarding him? Cloth asked. Let me destroy him, sir. He must have destroyed the pilot. It would be just for him to cease being as well. I gathered myself, getting ready to lunge at N7. He might have a cyber armor and a weapon, but I'd fight until the last. He'd learn what calling me a beast would earn him. You may be right concerning his irrationality, N7, Cloth said. Yet he is a ferocious creature, a veritable killer. If he destroyed an N-model android, that would be most impressive. Sir, N7 asked, would that not prove him too wild to trust? No, Cloth said, while watching me. I trust him to stir the other Earth beasts to violent action on the Corporation's behalf. The success of your mission rests on it. Wait a minute, I said. The androids are coming on the artifact hunt? Cloth seemed amused. You will need pilots and weapons officers. I can't send the Saurians. Why not? I asked. The humor evaporated. Do not question me, Cloth said. I am the Jelk, the superior. You are my property. I am not your property. I looked down lest he see my eyes. Someday I was going to put a collar on Cloth. Achilles had dragged Hector around Troy in his chariot. I was going to drag Cloth a lot farther than that. Please, sir, give me the word, N7 said. Let me destroy him. What kind of robot are you? I asked. I am an android with the same style of bio-brain as yours, N7 said, although mine is fully integrated and civilized. Yet your civilized brain wants to kill me. I needled him. You sound like an animal. Quiet, Cloth told us. N7 faced the screen and stood rigidly like a statue. I couldn't even see him breathe now. His eyelashes didn't even twitch. I waited, wondering what would happen next. Cloth seemed to measure me with his eyes. The Saurians cannot join the expedition for the simple reason that anyone capturing or finding a destroyed Saurian craft would realize they had acted on Jelk orders. That would implicate the corporation, and that must be avoided at all costs. I shouldn't have said it, but I did. So why are you telling me all this? Cloth flicked his fingers in a dismissive gesture. You cannot implicate the corporation. Any Earth beast beyond the emitting range of the central assault ship will die. What's that mean? I asked. I know you've received punishment shocks, Cloth said. The controller in your neck has other uses, too. If any Earth beast drifts beyond range of the emitter, the device will explode, killing the creature. What? This was outrageous. It is an obvious procedure. Cloth said. 
and it solves my dilemma of having any of you creatures inadvertently creating an incident. Now, wait a minute, I said. We're mercenaries, not slaves. Cloth gave me a pointy-toothed smile. You wear the controller. Therefore, it is clear that I make the rules. You are whatever I say you are. It would be good for you to finally come to terms with the idea. I'd never come to terms with it. Why should we go into battle wearing a suicide device? I asked. I'm glad you asked, Cloth said. It is central to the reason why you're alive, instead of drifting in space, heading toward this system's sun to incinerate. I scowled. You've proven yourself an interesting creature in more ways than one, Cloth said. You achieve results. That is your critical quality. With primitive weapons and after shrugging off the tamer ray, you stormed and captured a Saurian lander. Later, with nothing but your hands, you destroyed an abusive D.I., and it is possible you engineered an air car accident. Why you have done so doesn't interest me, although I suspect it has something to do with your outlandish notions of human equality. You are an odd beast, and it may be that your ideas give you strength of will. Very well, I accept that. The universe is a strange place, with many unusual creatures and events. A jelk does not insist reality conform to every one of his whims or preconceptions. A jelk uses what he finds to grind every particle of profit he can for himself and the corporation. It's what has made us the most powerful species in space. He loves bragging. How can I use that against him? Okay, I said. You seek to keep your species alive, Cloth said. I have found that that idea does indeed motivate you, Earth beasts. Now I am about to test your battle quality in a real situation. Is your fighting power inferior? or superior. I have let you visit the freighters on Earth for a single reason, for you to see how slender a thread the rest of humanity hangs on to existence. Yours is a physically strong but mentally and emotionally weak species. If I summon the freighters and I empty them in space, humanity as a species dies. The only thing keeping them alive is the earth beasts in my employ. Fight well, and your species lives. Fight poorly, or run away, and your species will cease to exist. You appreciate that fact more than the others do, and I believe you will help the others to recognize the importance of fighting well and getting me what I want. Okay. I said. I get it. And I did. Claw threatened humanity with extinction. He was a little better than the Lohars. If we failed to get him profits, goodbye freighters and goodbye humanity. It is for these reasons that you are alive, Claw said. Your vigor and desire to see your people live gives me leverage on you. Fight as hard for me as you fight for your people, and we can do business together. I hear you loud and clear, I said, and you can bet I'll fight hard. Are you giving me command of the space assault troopers? Don't be ridiculous, Cloth said. Then you would attempt to foment rebellion. You will lead your maniple, and the others will continue to lead theirs. I am, however, sending an Earth Beast representative to the Starkians. Who are they? 
I asked. They are independent contractors, little better than pirates, Cloth said with distaste. You will use their ships to reach the Altair system. As contractors, they're willing to deal with the corporation and earn some quick cash. Right, I said, beginning to understand his reasoning. And if Starkian ships take damage, you can deny the Jelk Corporation had anything to do with this mess. For such an emotional creature, you are perceptive, Cloth said. I believe I've made a wise choice deciding upon you as the Earth Beast representative. Sure, I said. Drag you around and around the walls of Troy while you choke to death. I'm still curious about the androids, though. Anyone who finds one of them will realize the Jelk funded the attack. You're right, except for one particular which makes you wrong, Cloth said. The N-series androids are fitted with similar explosive devices as you space assault troopers. We sell such androids everywhere, so their carcasses, just like yours, will not implicate us. I'll say this for Cloth. He was a cold-hearted businessman. I turned to the android, wondering how I could use this last piece of information. And you're okay with being wired to blow? I asked N7. We serve our creator, the android said. Our designer. Cloth cleared his throat in an imperious manner his chin rising as he did so. Let me rephrase, N7 said. We have no problem with Jelk directives. That's bloody marvelous, I said. When do we go? The expedition leaves tomorrow, Cloth said. Chapter 13 we were about to embark on our first mission as space assault troopers to steal, purloin, or acquire for the Jelk Corporation the Altair object, a forerunner artifact. As the Earth representative, I learned for the first time the number of commandos to be employed on the mission. I'd expected Cloth to use on the order of two or three thousand. Instead, to my amazement, the number was twenty-three thousand space assault troopers. The number surprised me for a variety of reasons. Firstly, as Cloth had hinted earlier, Rollo, Dimitri, Ella, and I had trained in maniples of twenty troopers per, never more. I was designated First Man Creed, the maniple leader. Under me were my sergeants or second men. Second Man Rollo, Second Man Dimitri, and so forth. It was a simple system, made so the likes of us could understand the hierarchy. In essence, the first men were lieutenants. The space assault troopers lacked anything higher, like captains, majors, colonels, or generals. It seemed like a weakness. I suppose Cloth figured the Starkians or the androids would act as captains, and maybe colonels, maneuvering the maniples as they wished. It seemed like an unwieldy way to do it. I mean, commanding hundreds of twenty-man maniples would put a lot of stress on the directing android or Starkian. Wouldn't it be easier to marshal us into larger formations, like companies or battalions, at least? Then we'd be trained to coordinate and fight as 23,000 commandos, not as hundreds of separate squads acting semi-independently. I didn't like such inefficiency, especially as we would likely have to pay for any errors with our lives. And as yet, we knew nothing about the forerunner object and how we were supposed to assault and acquire it. For a race concerned about their investment, the Jelks seemed to be setting us up for a lot of casualties. Despite Cloth's words, it took another week before we actually left the solar system. My bones needed the extra time to mend, and I exercised hard to bring myself back to peak condition. Finally, we left Earth and the solar system behind as the fleet entered its first jump route or line. 
I've been wondering about that for some time. Not jump route specifically, but how the aliens beat the laws of physics. Things with mass, like a spaceship, and light, too, of course, couldn't move faster than the speed of light. That was an immutable law of nature. Normally, a journey at light speed would take 4.3 years to travel to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to Earth with planets. Nothing with mass could reach the speed of light, but close enough so that all kinds of problems arose, like time dilation. Why would that be a problem? Well, consider. Back on Earth during the Age of Sail, galleons might be gone for months and even a year, but not for 4.3 years and certainly not for 10 or 20 years. So how could anyone have a star empire or an interstellar corporation while traveling within the constraints of light speed or a bit under light speed? The answer was clear. They couldn't. You needed magic, or a science we'd never heard about, in order to flit from star system to star system fast enough to have interstellar empires and corporations. The technology that allowed ships to jump along these lines was just that. Think of one of those connect-the-dot puzzles you used to draw as a kid. The dots were the star systems. The pencil lines were the jump lanes, lines, points, whatever you want to call them. A spaceship went in at one end and popped out the other in a few hours, having traveled many light years. Just like in connect-the-dots, some points had one line running through them and some had three, five, or seven lines. Those dots with seven different routes were strategic points in the stellar system. Control one of those critical star systems and you could control entire routes. None of us had seen a star map or knew which jump route went to which star. Our N-series android minders simply told us to get ready for a jump. Then we hurried to our cots, lay down, strapped in, and endured. After the first jump, we learned they were bad with terrible headaches, cramps, disorientation, and vomiting. We dreaded being ordered to get ready after that. I think even the androids hated the jumps, which made me inclined toward thinking of them as living creatures instead of just machines. And that didn't help my conscience any. After three jumps, we met the Starkians, the contractors who would pilot the frigates and corvettes to take us into the Altair system. I had no idea what Cloth had told them about us. My introduction to the Starkians came a few days later aboard one of their vessels. N7 entered our training area and told me to accompany him to the meeting. Now? I asked. My maniple practiced hand-to-hand -hand combat on the mats, with my second men prowling around to make sure no one became too angry. It is time, N7 said. Like before, he wore cyber armor and carried a sidearm. He looked like the perfect choir boy, with artificially fair features, trusting eyes and smooth, bioplastic skin. He had the stamp of perfection. Not of a Nietzsche superman, but of the ultimate butt-kissing underling. Do I need to wear my bio suit? I asked. Negative, N7 said. Let me shower first. Come now, N7 said. It is an order. I'd fought several practice rounds with several of my soldiers, and my shirt was sweaty, while a welt showed on my left cheek because one of the boys had almost pinned me. Sure, boss, I said. And if my stench offends the Starkians, then what? The Starkians are under Jelt command. N7 said. Your odor or lack thereof is meaningless. Negative, I said. I'm the Earth rep and I'm showering and shaving. Gotta look presentable, you know? Give me ten minutes and I'll be with you. I have given you an order, N7 said. That's right, and I'm complying with the order. After I take a shower. The android drew his sidearm, pointing the barrel at my face so I could see inside the pitted orifice. This gun had been used plenty of times, which I found interesting. I grinned and made a show of looking around the crowded chamber. My maniple of troopers had already stopped practicing. 
most of them lying on the mats and breathing heavily. They now stood to their feet and glowered at N7. Hey, how about that? I said. If you shoot me, these mercenaries will tear you to pieces. I do not fear destruction, N7 said. Bully for you, I said. That makes you a fool and a liability. N7 stepped closer so the barrel bumped against my forehead. A good soldier fears death, I told him. The fear helps motivate the soldier to action and thereby keeps him alive to fight again another day. Fear is akin to cowardice, N7 said. Cowardice is against the laws of androids. You want to obey Cloth's orders, is that right? I asked, deciding on a different tack. I do obey. Now you must obey. Right, I said. If you're torn to pieces, destroyed, you will not have obeyed Cloth's order to go to the Starkian meeting. You will have made those orders impossible. I, too, will be missing. In fact, our arguing with each other is eating up time. I'm going to shower, and then I'll be right with you. For the first time since he'd entered the chamber, N7's head swiveled as he surveyed my maniple of troopers inching toward him. Abruptly, he holstered his sidearm, folded his plastic arms across his chest, and half turned away from me. I hadn't liked the barrel pressed against my forehead and I hadn't been sure which way N7 would jump. Maybe it had been foolish pushing him so far, but I had my reasons for wanting to be presentable to the Starkians. I'd also just gained more credibility in the eyes of my men, and showed them what kind of human haters the androids were. Good choice, Chief, I told him. Rollo, finish the exercises, then use your best judgment. I don't know how long I'll be gone. With that, I jogged for the nearest shower. I didn't want to keep the android waiting. I wore a jumpsuit uniform, my buoy knife, and a spacesuit with a helmet hanging on the back near my neck. I rode beside N7 in the shuttle he piloted. Behind us drifted seven Jelk battle jumpers, ugly utilitarian vessels. Our shuttle was a speck compared to them. Below swirled an orange gas giant maybe 100,000 kilometers away. Outlined against the gas giant drifted a hundred or so shark-shaped spacecraft. They looked deadly, but what did I know about space battle? Precious little was the answer. Much farther away, about half the size of the moon as seen from Earth, blazed this system's sun. How far were we from the solar system? Three jumps away, I knew, but what did that mean? Those are the pirate ships? I asked, pointing at the dark-shaped vessels. That is the Starkian contract fleet, N7 said. There were a lot of them. N7 ignored the comment. I glanced at him sidelong. Something had been bothering me for some time. Why had the Jelk made the androids based on humans from Earth? Had that occurred on a whim? Or was there a significant reason for it? How old are you, N7? I asked. He surprised me by answering. Five standard years, he said. How long is a standard year compared to an Earth year? I asked. I am six and a half Earth years old. He said. You're young. No. I have survived three times the average time span of an N-series android. Oh, I said. I wondered why his kind lived such short lives. So I asked him. N-7 took his time answering, finally saying, We are mining androids. Excuse me? I said. The N-series are normally used to mine high-gravity planets or work the extractors of particularly massive gas giants. 
Why did Cloth change you and the others to a military model? I asked. One does not question a jelk directive. No, I suppose not, I said. You were given battle upgrades, I presume? Of course, N7 said. Five standard years, huh? So, you're born as adults? N7 glanced at me with his expressionless eyes. Why do you ask these questions? Just passing the time, I said. And figuring out what makes you androids tick. He glanced at me again. I do not believe you, First Man Creed. You are a clever beast, and you... Hey, I said, grabbing an arm. Let's get one thing straight. Cloth gets to call me a beast because he gave Earth the freighters. And because I'm going to drag him by the throat until I rub all his flesh down to the bones. You, on the other hand, can call me a man. N7 stared into my eyes and said, Beast. Don't do it, Creed. You gotta use Mr. Plastic Man. One, two, three. I grinned, ruefully. Sure, you hate my guts. I get it. And you're jealous of the real humans. Maybe I can't blame you. I... Desist, he said. Your guile will not succeed on me. You are the android killer. We know you, First Man Creed. No android will succumb to your cleverness again. Is that groupthink? I asked. You androids all think as a team? You are witnessing a survival mechanism built into all androids of the N-series, he said. Once we comprehend a danger, we remember it and act accordingly. We grow. You grow, huh? That's great. So what about these Starkians? What can you tell me about them? You and I are attending a strategy session, N7 said. There we shall plan the assault tactics. I raised my eyebrows. The Starkians interested me. I knew absolutely nothing about them except that they were pirates. At least by Cloth's reckoning. What's more, they were hireable contractors. I suspected Cloth would give them a cut of the take from the Altair object. It seemed to imply the Starkians wouldn't care if the others knew they'd done this. Cloth, on the other hand, didn't want anyone to know about his or the corporation's involvement. Why would that interest me? Maybe humanity would need to hire a few contractors someday. I had plans, but I knew nothing about the interstellar situation. Here was a chance to learn more. Well, I take back that I didn't know anything. I knew a few things. The Lohars fought the corporation. The Jelk lived for profits. And I would make every jack tar of them pay for what had happened to my beloved world. N7 and I traveled the rest of the way in silence, docked beside the largest of the shark-shaped vessels, it was the size of a city block, and waited as reverberating clangs and clanks told of heavy machines operating around us. Finally, N7 rose and donned his helmet. I did likewise. We exited the shuttle and soon floated weightlessly down extremely narrow corridors. The bulkheads seemed to close in around us, and the corridors turned much too sharply at times. I noticed fist-sized portholes along the bottom of the wall like giant mouse holes. I had no idea what they were for. At last, without any guards or Starkians in sight, we reached a small entrance. It opened, and N7 and I had to duck to enter a wide and far too low of a chamber filled with creatures. Gravity took hold in the chamber, almost catching me by surprise. N7 knelt before a large, kidney-shaped table and took off his helmet. I took off mine, too, and an animal stench hit me like a sucker punch. It was worse than a barn. 
More like some monkey exhibit at a zoo where the attendants had forgotten to clean the cages. I had to work from holding my nose or making a face. Could an android smell? The Starkians were the size of baboons, and looked as furry and as ugly. They sported long canines at the end of their snouts, and most had manes like a lion or a dominant male baboon. Each wore a harness of straps and buckles over their furry, smelly bodies, and they drank from silver-colored teacups, or what looked like teacups. It was a disconcerting image to see them stretch their lips past those fangs and take dainty sips. I counted fourteen Starkians in the low-ceiling chamber. I sat down, sitting cross-legged, refusing to kneel as N7 did. The ceiling loomed a mere inch above our heads now. If we'd remained standing, we would have had to stoop the entire time. I wondered if the Starkians had chosen this room for a reason. Was it a tactic or joke on their part to make bigger creatures kneel? The heaviest Starkian must have weighed sixty, maybe seventy pounds. There were computer screens along the walls, controls and a big hollow image in the center of the kidney-shaped tables. None of the Starkians sat on chairs, but squatted, as you'd expect baboon-like creatures to do. Why did they smell so bad? Their fur looked sleek and smooth, as if it was well-groomed, not like some matted offal. I breathed through my mouth, almost gagging several times. Greetings, N7, the biggest Starkian said. He had white or gray streaks in his fur, and his muzzle was more wrinkled than any others present. Greetings, Naga Gobo, N7 said. That's his name, I whispered. Naga is his name, N7 whispered back to me. Gobo is his rank. It means Lord of Ships. Got it, I whispered. Is there trouble? Naga Gobo asked. He'd keenly watched our exchange. Your beast seems restless. Will he heal to your command? He is well, N7 said. I can speak for myself, I said. Who were these horribly smelling aliens that they figured they could call me a beast? They were the creatures. Their reaction surprised me. All fourteen Starkians drew weapons from their harnesses and aimed short, ugly tubes at me. Tell your fighting beast to heal, Naga Gobo said. The Jelk assured us the creature could comprehend commands and would not run amok among us. Have you taken a good look at N7? I said. I couldn't believe this. Why did all the aliens think we were beasts? Do you see any differences between the two of us? The Starkians watched me through narrowed eyes. None of the weapon tubes wavered or moved away. You may put up your slug throwers, N7 said. Shah Cloth has given you his word. The Earth Beast will remain calm in your presence. You should have already taught your animal to know its place in front of its betters, Naga Gobo said. I swallowed my retorts. These were aliens. Stench had nothing to do with their abilities and scientific knowledge. Yeah, maybe this was why Cloth had wanted me to come. Maybe the Jelk wished me to understand my place in the interstellar community. To the Starkians, I was a beast. To the Jelk and the Lohars, I was a beast. A wild thing to use and possibly tame for combat. It was time to absorb the reality of the situation. The fact that we on Earth would have considered the Starkians as animals wasn't lost on me. It went even deeper, though. To the interstellar crowd, Earthers were the bottom of the heap. Fighting beasts. Did other star-faring races use creatures to fight their wars? Yes. Hadn't Cloth's idea been to capture several hundred million humans to fight as slave creatures among the stars? The more I learned, the less I liked it. 
Even if we could free ourselves from under the Jelk thumb, how would the rest of the interstellar races treat us? Wait and learn, I told myself. See what this forerunner object is supposed to be, anyway. Maybe it's something you can use. The strategy session quickly became interesting. Naga Gobo adjusted some controls below the tabletop, and a fast-spinning A-class star appeared in the hollow image. It was the star Altair, and it rotated quickly enough to make it an oblong sun with a flattened top and bottom. Planets appeared in bright blue around Altair. The first four were Mars-like planets, while the next two were gas giants, two supersized Jupiter-like monsters. Between the gas giants was a thicker-than-normal asteroid belt. Nagagobo continued to manipulate the controls, bringing the asteroid belt up close and then picking a small area of it and zooming in. Soon enough, a silvery Taurus appeared. As the zoom continued, the Taurus grew, and so did a veritable host of orbiting rocks and sandy debris around it. The Altair Object! Naga Gobo declared. The Starkians around the conference table began to stir and lean toward the hollow image. I'd been getting used to the smell. It worsened as they moved, and I endured, waiting for the sharpness of the stench to weaken again or for me to get used to it. Several of the creatures got twitchy fingers, some of them opening and closing their baboon-like hands. It made the Starkians seem like thieves eager to grab the object and dash out of the room with it. They're contract pirates indeed, I thought to myself. It's a wonder Cloth trusts them at all. The file is old, Naga Gobo said, indicating the hollow image. But I was assured it is an original and contains trusted data. Notice the gun emplacements to the right. The hollow image zoomed again, focusing on one of the small asteroids circling the object. My eyes widened. It seemed like a regular rocky asteroid, but the surface held several black matted structures, looking like octagonal biodomes. The firing domes are of Lohar design, N7 noted. Naga Gobo nodded. The Lohar Fifth Legion is far from home, but it's said that each legionary has sworn an oath to the Jade League to protect the Forerunner artifact as if it was their home planet. Questions bubbled on the tip of my tongue, but I kept my mouth shut. I listened and tried to learn. The Jade League has declared the Altair system sacred to the Creator, Naga Gobo said. Every member of the League has signed a compact in agreement with the theocratic principle. If we attempt this mission and are found out, the League members will increase their efforts to annihilate the Starkians. I turned away from the hollow image to look at Naga Gobo. Let me get this straight, I said. We're making the attack on holy ground? Or in holy space? Naga Gobo growled angrily. Why must your beast utter speech at me? It is offensive and insulting. The creature should speak to you, not to us. The Lohars attacked their home planet, N7 said. Until then, the Earth beasts knew nothing about civilization. Naga Gobo sniffed in an exaggerated manner. This is true. The Lohars used thermonuclear warheads on their main urban centers, N7 said gravely, and laced the atmosphere with level five bioterminators. Barbaric! Naga Gobo grunted. Before their awaking several months ago, the Earth beasts believed themselves cultured and highly civilized, N7 said even though they continued to practice similar genocidal tactics upon each other. Once again, Naga Gobo sniffed exaggeratedly. The Earth Beasts desire revenge upon the Lohars, N7 added. I realize this and do not need an android explaining the obvious, Naga Gobo said. 
and Seven dipped his head as if apologizing. Sharkloth is cunning, Naga Gobo told the assembled. The other Starkians nodded, with their lips pulling back to reveal their fangs. I'd swear it was a Starkian grin or smile of appreciation. Yes, Naga Gobo said. It is possible Cloth engineered the event in order to gain these fiercely motivated battle creatures. However, if he did so, the Lohar took the bay too well and killed too many humans. N7 glanced at me, but I kept my features impassive. This was an idea I'd have to explore. The Lohar Empire grows with the passing of each year, Nagagobo said. They have become first in the Jade League, and they desire a holy war against the Jelk Corporation. I realize that you have spoken with Shah Klaath, N7 said. You are aware of the importance of the Forerunner artifacts to the League. The Lohars particularly venerate each artifact and the star system where it resides. They believe the First Ones built the objects. I am aware of Lohar primary doctrine, Naga Gobo said. I'm surprised an N-series android should speak of such things. Shah Klaath instructed me. Naga Gobo held up one of his hands. This is a strategy session. Let us stick to the issue and not become sidetracked. Exactly, N7 said. There is a strategic point to my words. If we succeed in breaking through the Lohar Fifth Legion and dismantling the asteroid maze, we can remove the Altair object. Remove it to where? Naga Gobo asked. I do not know, N7 said. Only Cloth knows. The Jelk will cheat us! Naga Gobo shouted. The others in the chamber muttered angrily, shifting about. No, N7 said. Shah Cloth will pay you in Iridium as bargained. Naga Gobo shook his head. Why will he bother to pay us once he has the object in his sole possession? Shah Klaath ordered me to tell you of a powerful reason why you can know he will pay, N7 said. If he fails to pay, you could always gain revenge on him by telling the members of the Jade League who took the object. And thereby implicate ourselves, Naga Gobo said. No, no, if we did such a thing, the Starkians would have to leave the Quadrant and enter the Beyond. There is no doubt that the consequences of your words would be dire for all, N7 said. Even so, you possess this knowledge as a bargaining tool. Shah Klaath realizes this. He will pay as agreed. The risks, Naga Gobo said. I am to instruct you. Instruct us, Naga Gobo asked loudly. An N-series mining android wishes to instruct me, the leader of the fleet. This is infamy. The other Starkians hooted in outrage as they pounded the table with their fists. I felt as if I'd entered the African wilds of some Tarzan novel, where great apes had gained higher intelligence and technology. To say the least, it was disconcerting. And Seven stood. I stood up behind him, ready to reach into my spacesuit and pull out the bowie knife. At our standing, the table pounding stopped. The Starkians took out their squat gun tubes and pointed them at N7 and me. There must be a defect in my processing centers, N7 said. I spoke incorrectly. I meant to say inform you instead of saying the other ill-chosen word. Naga Gobo wrinkled his snout and slowly began to nod. I accept your explanation. It is forgotten. Please sit down, you and your beast. And Seven sat, and I did likewise. Sullenly, the Starkians holstered their weapons, a few muttering about us. Good, 
Naga Gobo said. Now, what is it that Shah Krath wishes passed on to us? Taking the Forerunner object and making it disappear will weaken the Lohar position in the Jade League, N7 said. The Lohar Fifth Region will be destroyed, or at least disgraced. The primary doctrine will suffer a critical blow, and Lohar theology will also suffer. The Forerunner theft might be enough to shatter the League into its component parts. Would that not benefit the Starkians? Indeed. Naga Gobo said in an oily voice, as he brushed his mane like a vain model, although using his fingers. Shah Cloth's guile runs deep. I am impressed. He glanced at me. And I begin to perceive why he uses untested beasts to make the main assault on the object. I was beginning to perceive, too. If the members of the Jade League arrived later to find the Forerunner object missing and floating, dead earthlings in its place, what would they do to the last humans? Would the Lohars return to Earth in a religious fury to exterminate us in Jihad? And was Naga Gobo even partly right in thinking Cloth might have engineered the Lohar attack upon Earth? In any case, we would be the Fall Guys. For the umpteenth time, it hit home how little I knew of the wider interstellar civilization. I thought we'd been a cipher in a slave-hunting scheme to make more profits for the Jelk. Now it sounded like something more ominous was going on. What was the Jade League? What were Forerunner objects, anyway? What did that have to do with the Creator? And by Creator, did the aliens mean God, or their idea of one? It was strange to think of aliens as religious and having religious wars, jihads, or crusades. I'd always believed that uniquely human. I looked at the hollow image again. The Lohar Fifth Legion apparently lived on the small asteroids and debris circling the silver-gleaming Taurus. How big was that thing? I know you Starkians hate hearing my voice, I said. But what kind of spacecraft guards the Altair object? Naga Gobo stared at N7. You possess a clever beast. It asks wise questions. Yes, N7 said. Perhaps you should leave it here for us, Naga Gobo said. My blood ran cold. Is this why Cloth had wanted me to come? Yet something troubled me. I'd come to listen and learn. So why was Naga Gobo upset if I understood? Why had I been included otherwise? This creature is the killer among killers, N7 was saying. The Earth Beasts hate the Lohars. Once their champion tells the others how the Fifth Legion guards the artifact, the others will war with even bitterer ferocity. It spoke of space battle, Naga Gobo said. Does it realize? May I add a word of caution? N7 asked quickly. Naga Gobo seemed to consider this. Yes, please do. It is best not to speak of space battle in the Earth Beast's presence, N7 said. But only how we will deploy against the final barrier. You will lead the assault troopers. Naga Gobo asked. I will direct them, yes, N7 said. I studied the back of the android's head. This didn't seem like the same model as the one who had spoken about me to Cloth yesterday. Had N7 already received some of those modifications he'd been wanting? I dropped that line of thinking as Naga Gobo adjusted the hollow image yet again. I began to gain an understanding of what we would be doing. Rollo, Dimitri, Ella, I, and the others. This was a mass assault, and we would have to work through the maze of shifting, orbiting rock and blocks of sand circling the artifact, all while facing emplaced strong points and an entire legion of Lohar space soldiers. This was going to be a bloody fight over a holy object to the religious soldiers guarding it. That didn't sound easy or good for us. 
I listened as Nagagobo went over his strategy and tactics for deploying and giving us enough firepower to take out the Lohar Fifth Legion. Suddenly, 23,000 Earthers didn't seem like enough. How long were we supposed to survive out in space? Beasts. They thought of us as fighting beasts. Did one care how many running dogs it would take to clear a minefield? Some generals would gladly pay the butcher's bill with other men's lives. But what if the general was an alien? He used animals to do the fighting. Our well-being wouldn't matter to him. I studied the hollow image. There had to be a better way than how Nagagobo was planning to do this. I wish I'd brought a pencil and paper to take notes. Even better, I'd like to have a recorder and to take pictures of the hollow image and the torus-shaped object. I concentrated, willing myself to remember as much as I could. We Earthers would have to have our own strategy session. For a while now, I'd begun to believe I was getting things under control. I was wrong. Possibly dead wrong. And I couldn't back out now, or Cloth would lift the freighters off Earth and empty the living cargoes into space. This was bad. Really bad. Chapter 14 Fortunately, N-7 took me with him when he left the Starkian ship. We returned to the Jelk battle jumper, and I hurried into the mercenary area of the vessel. This is what it looks like, I said. With a pencil and paper, I sketched the forerunner artifact for the others. Rallo, Dimitri, and Ella sat around a cafeteria table with me. We ate broccoli, beans, and beef. The others leaned over their plates to stare at the drawing. I'd been telling them about the Starkian meeting. After penciling the donut-shaped artifact, I began tapping the paper, putting dots around it. Those are the shielding asteroids? Rollo asked. Asteroids and clouds of sand, I said. Rollo shook his head to indicate he didn't understand. I'd seen similar shakes for many years. It was more a quick twitch of the head, almost like a tick, with his lips pressed together firmly. The Starkian leader, Naga Gobo, said each asteroid and sand cluster circles or fully orbits the object every 15 minutes, I said. The continuous maze helps to keep unwarranted vessels from getting too near the artifact. The asteroids and sand clouds are going to make it hard to get to the Taurus, Rollo said. That's right, I said. I was told, or N7 was told, that the Lohar pilot single ships through the maze. There's a coded passageway through this mess, a strict procedure to follow. Supposedly, the Lohar Fifth Legion pilots are the only ones who can penetrate the orbital maze, taking someone to the inner space around the artifact. Why would anyone go to such trouble to do all this? Ella Timoshenko asked. What does the object do? I don't know, I said. I do know it has religious significance. Ella, who studied my drawing, looked up sharply at me. She had changed like the rest of us, bulked up muscles and neural fibers, but she still had pretty features. You've heard that the aliens call it a forerunner artifact? I asked. All three of them nodded. Well, I said. They believe the first ones built it. That sounds intriguing, Ella said. Who are the first ones? I'm going to assume the names have a meaning, I said. First ones sound like the first ones in space. Reasonable, Ella said. A forerunner likely means... Ah, yes, yes, of course, Ella said, interrupting me. The scientists love these kind of puzzles. Forerunner likely means the object or artifact is a precursor to those presently in control of the space lanes. And you say the aliens worship those things? Rollo asked. I'm not clear on that, I said. The Starkians didn't let me ask too many questions. 
But like I told you before, when they call us beasts, they mean exactly that. Would you explain something complicated to a dog? Not unless the dog's name was Lassie or Rin Tin Tin, Rollo said. Yeah, okay, I said. I'm thinking the object or artifact is more like the bones of a saint to a Catholic. Yeah, but even that isn't exactly right. The artifact isn't living, or at least to the best of my knowledge it isn't alive. Apparently the Lohars and other Jade League members venerate it like a relic because, in some manner that I don't understand yet, it represents the creator to them. Creator? Ella asked. Do you mean as in God or Allah? Yeah, that's right. Preposterous, Ella said indignantly. These are intelligent beings with the science of star travel. They cannot possibly believe in God. I wondered how highly Ella would think of the Starkians if she'd smelled them. I didn't ask, but I said, I believe God exists, and I'm intelligent. Ella gave me a quizzical glance. You are serious. You believe in the old fables, in Bronze Age myths. Of course he does, Dimitri said. And they're not myths. Ella gave the Cossack a glance. It told me they'd had this discussion before. I decided not to debate my beliefs with her right there. We had more pressing matters to thrash through. With my pencil, I indicated the paper. This is deadly serious stuff. The Lohars, maybe every member of the Jade League, thinks of the Altair system as holy ground. I'm guessing that the closer one gets to the Forerunner artifact, the holier the space becomes. The Lohar Fifth Legion took a religious oath to defend the object as if it was their home planet. Rollo grinned savagely. You're saying that if we can take this object from them, that they'll feel it deep in their guts? No, I said. If we take it, they won't feel a thing. But you just told us, Rollo said. They won't feel anything, because for us to take it from them, they're all going to have to be dead, I said. Oh, Rollo said. Yes, Dimitri said. Good. We killed them all. I agree. I nodded, grinning at him, and kept explaining. From the way the Starkians and N7 spoke about them, the Fifth Legion is an elite outfit. I'm guessing that makes them pretty tough. This is absurd, Ella said. The aliens possess spacecraft, science far in advance of us. They cannot continue to hold these ancient superstitions. I know, I said, speaking before Dimitri did. I find the universe we're in to be highly confusing, too. Absolutely smelly baboons called me a beast, and religious zealots guarding holy sites in space practice genocide against Earth. My point to telling you all this is to let you know that we're going to be in for a stiff battle, and I don't like the odds. There's more? Rollo asked. Just what we've been saying to each other these past few weeks, I said. We lack proper battlefield organization. We're divided into maniples, but don't have any higher organization so we can attack with coordination. It is clear that the Jelk do not trust us, Ella said. Yeah, I said. And that distrust is going to get us killed. What do you suggest we do about it? Rollo asked. I don't know what else we can do, I said. I suppose just fight like hell and win. The Starkian battle plan is simple to the point of obviousness. They're going to mass all around the object and offload us as closely as possible to the orbiting asteroids. The androids will pilot the assault ships, taking us the final distance. N7 doesn't plan on landing on the small orbiting objects. That means we're going to have to use the sleds to get near enough and then to use our thruster packs to land and take the fight to the Lohars. During all this maneuvering, Ella said, the Lohar domes will undoubtedly be firing on us. Yeah, undoubtedly, I echoed. 
Our paymasters expect us to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Rollo asked. Surface fighting, I said. The Starkians will match their velocity to the orbiting objects. They'll use beams and missiles to soften up the domes. None of this makes sense, Ella said. Why not just blast the shielding asteroids and debris with massive nuclear bombs and heavy beams, clearing the way for transporters? I managed to get N7 to ask the Starkians that, I said. You won't like the answer. More Bronze Age nonsense? Ella asked. In outrage, Dimitri slapped the table. The Starkians don't want to risk damaging the artifact, I said, shaking my head at the Cossack. From what I can gather, the contractors are outcasts, at least to the Jade League members. I don't know if the Starkians buy into the Creator belief, but they don't want the League members to hunt them down in religious fury. Therefore, they're going to use us to take out the Lohar Fifth Legion. In that way, the Starkians, and the Jelk, too, I'd imagine, don't have to worry about bombs or beams hitting and possibly marring the Forerunner artifact. I have the feeling these objects are priceless. Like an ancient Ming vase? Ella asked leaning back in her chair as she stroked her chin. Sure, I said. I have a question, Dimitri said. I studied the blocky man before nodding. What are Lohars like? Dimitri asked. I've been wondering about that for a long time already. Good question, I said. I tried to ask the Starkians and N7 too, but... Everyone ignored me about it. That does not make sense, Dimitri said. They should tell us. We need knowledge of the enemy so we can plan better. So we can kill all the Lohars. I shrugged. It might be redundant to say this, but how would you tell a pack of hunting dogs about bears? You wouldn't. We are not dogs, Dimitri said. Yeah, I said, and for a moment my anger against the aliens smoldered. We are men, Dimitri said, as he slapped his chest. We must adjust ourselves to the facts, Ella said. We must view reality as it is and plan accordingly. That is the only rational response to our situation. That's what I'm trying to say, I told them. You wouldn't tell dogs how to attack bears. You'd bring the dogs to the hunt and let them loose. That's what the aliens are doing with us. Yes, Ella said, nodding. That is a poetical way to describe it, but accurate. These aliens believe us to be inferior to them. Yet the more I learn of these space races, the less I like them or understand their thought processes. I find myself growing disillusioned with them. I have another question, Dimitri asked. Shoot, I said. The Cossack cocked his head, looking befuddled at me. That means go ahead and ask, I said. Ah, Dimitri said. Here is question. How many Lohars are in a legion? Yeah. I'd like to know that, too, I said. They would not tell you that, either, Dimitri asked. We'll know tomorrow, I said, standing, pushing the drawing toward them. That's the end of the briefing. You know enough now to tell the others. I don't think Cloth or N7 intends to give us mercenaries a briefing, so we're it. Copy the drawing, show as many others as you can, and tell them what you know and to pass it on. I'll do the same thing, and hopefully by tomorrow everyone will have an idea of what to do. Ella asked a few more questions. Then we split up to go tell the others what to expect. It was precious little, but the truth was we were lucky to even know that much. You know enough now to tell the others. I don't think Cloth or N7 intends to give us mercenaries a briefing, so we're it. Copy the drawing, show as many others as you can, and tell them what you know and to pass it on. 
I'll do the same thing, and hopefully by tomorrow everyone will have an idea of what to do. Ella asked a few more questions. Then we split up to go tell the others what to expect. It was precious little, but the truth was we were lucky to even know that much. Tomorrow came all too soon. We ate in a packed cafeteria, heard an android give us boarding instructions over a loudspeaker, and march to our designated areas. There we donned our biosuits, boots, and helmets. My maniple, along with others, hurried down a large corridor and entered a monstrous hangar bay. There must have been fifty assault ships parked here. Each could carry two hundred troopers, or ten maniples altogether. Soon enough, we filed aboard Assault Ship 6. Inside, we settled oxygen tank and thruster packs onto our backs. Only then did androids hand us our laser rifles and a sling sack each of pulse grenades. That's all we had, other than the sleds to take us to the black-matted Lohar domes. Maybe as bad, if we strayed too far from the central ship, the control device in our necks would explode and we'd be dead. If we couldn't blast our way into the domes, we'd be just as dead. If. This is it, I said. Deciding endless worry wasn't going to help me or my maniple. Troopers turned toward me. I raised my right arm and gave them a thumbs up. Afterward, I waited. Finally, I felt acceleration, and I realized we had left the Jelk battle jumper. There weren't any windows in the assault ship for us to see outside. Maybe more than anything else, that told us this was an alien vehicle. Human-designed assault ships would have given us windows or screens showing what the outer cameras could see. This felt too much like a box. Our masters would bring us to the battle zone, open the box, and shout, Attack! The acceleration pressing us into our seats meant the assault ship headed toward the Starkian contract vessels. Once inside their motherships, we'd head to the jump point and enter the route that would take us to a star system. From there, we'd use another jump route that led directly to Altair. That meant we'd be making two jumps before combat. None of us were looking forward to that. Time passed far too slowly. Our vessel thrummed later, and we shook once, possibly landing onto the deck of a Starkian mothership, Clangs and clanks told of Starkian machinery locking us into place. Thirty minutes later, a voice said into my earphones, Jump in ten minutes. All around our packed assault ship, troopers squirmed, including me. The ten minutes ticked by with agonizing slowness. I tried to think about anything other than jumping. Why did it feel so awful? I don't know. No one explained much to us. I was getting tired of that. I wanted to make them talk. I... We jumped, and it hurt. My guts, my head, and my eyes, everything pounded and pulsed. It seemed to last forever. Even though I was strapped in, I tried to double up. I felt the biosuit stir on my skin. The living armor didn't like the jump either, it seemed. Muscles cramped. I twisted in my seat. I called out, and in the end, I simply endured. Finally, far too long of a time later, the pain and twisting stopped like the snap of fingers. We jumped successfully. No one said anything for some time. Probably most of the troopers felt like me, grateful to just sit and not feel pain. I don't ever want to do that again. A man finally said. A murmur of agreement swept through the troopers. We'd taken off our helmets some time ago. Why does it have to hurt? One asked. This is BS, said another. A third replied, You got that right, brother. The aliens can have the stars. I just want to go home. There was more of the same. Troopers letting off steam. It went on until acceleration pressed us against our seats. Now what? a woman asked. Are we heading into combat? No, I said. We're heading for the next jump point. We're jumping again? a man complained. Don't worry, I said. You'll get to fight the Lohar soon enough. There was strained laughter and growls of eagerness. 
We were all wound tight. Too tight. None of us knew anything about what went on around us. None of us saw anything in this damned box. This time, we didn't have any warning. Troopers talked quietly together. I remember glancing a row over. Two men had the top of their heads practically touching. Each held cards. One was in the process of stuffing a drawn card into his hand when the awful feeling of jump struck by surprise. We came out on the other end in the Altair system. As the troopers came down from the funk of jump, troopers cursed and raved at our thoughtless minders. After enough bitching, I told them to pipe down. We're in the combat zone, I said. Put your helmets back on and stay alert. That got the troopers to blinking, thinking, and donning the heavy helmets. It was crazy. We rode into a space battle, and none of us knew if beams fired near or if enemy missiles had gained lock-on and zoomed the final distance to our mothership. We waited for N7 or some other android to tell us to get ready. Back in the solar system, we'd unloaded onto plenty of practice battlefields, so we knew what to do when the time came. Still. This would be the first time under fire for most of them. Rollo leaned against my left shoulder. Afghanistan was nothing like this, eh? He asked. I don't know, I said. You never rode a chopper into battle? At least I could look around and see what was going on, Rollo said. What about seals and a sub? Maybe that's what this is like? We shot the breeze for a time, trying to distract ourselves. Others did likewise. Finally, our headphones crackled into life. This is N7 speaking. The Starkians have successfully taken the Guardian ships by surprise, eliminating 85% of the enemy spacecraft. Three have escaped, however, running to warn the nearest Jade League star system. The other surviving Guardian vessels are attacking the Starkian ships. Estimated time to offloading is three hours. Three hours? Rollo said. That's a long time to let our gut seethe. Eighty-five percent of the enemy ships destroyed sounds good to me, Dimitri said. Yeah, I said. We were doing it. We were in the middle of a space battle, and we couldn't see a thing. I wonder if this was how the Marines felt storming Japanese beaches in World War II, or the soldiers who landed at the Normandy beaches on D-Day. Fighter planes, submarines, artillery, battleships, and cruisers had pounded the area and each other. But in the end, warriors and assault boats had to storm ashore and take the terrain. We were the marines here. Mercenaries treated worse than dogs. In three hours or thereabouts, we would leap into the void of the vacuum of space and face elite Lohar legionaries on their precious asteroids. I swallowed in a tight throat. It was my chance for some payback against the bastards who had destroyed my world. It was funny, but I didn't feel the rage just then. I felt fear. I wanted to live. I didn't want to die in the Altair system fighting over a religious artifact that meant nothing to me. Remember what they did to your dad, I whispered to myself. I tried to do that. Instead, I waited and endured. That was another funny thing. Waiting in my seat was worse than going through a jump. The anticipation of something terrible felt worse than actually going through the terrible thing. Strange. Who were the first ones, anyway? Why was a forerunner artifact considered to be a holy thing? I wondered what the thing did, if anything. Was the object like an alien Stonehenge? Was it like the Cathedral of Notre Dame, or was it like the black stone the Muslims kept in Mecca? I hate the waiting, Rollo said. You got that straight, I told him. Do you think we'll win? he asked. We have to, I said. Don't blow smoke, Rollo said. Really? Do you think we'll win? Tell me the truth, Creed. What do you think is going to happen? I licked my lips. I don't have a clue, my brother, but we're going to find out soon enough. 
Yeah, he said. You got that right. The hard maneuvering began soon thereafter. It was like being in an amusement park on a ride without windows, just jerked and slammed back and forth. Because the ship was in space, in a vacuum, there wasn't any noise from outside, like explosions. But there were plenty of noises in the spacecraft, maybe from the Starkeyed mothership. The sounds were clangs, hisses, creaks, ruptures, more hissing. The sounds never ended. We are leaving the mothership, N7 told us over our helmet speakers. Most of the other noises ended because a roar of thrusters took over. Instead of being jerked back and forth, the mothership likely jinking to save our lives, we were shoved hard against our seats. High acceleration slammed us back, and it continued. I hated this not knowing. I could tell by the stark expressions and the pale features around me through helmet visors that the troopers hated the suspense, too. I clicked onto the wide channel and said loudly, We're going in. Heads whipped around. Troopers looked at each other with hope. Are we finally doing it? Another maniple firstman asked me. That's right, I roared. The Starkians beat these sons of bitches in space combat, and now we're taking it down into their throats. Is everyone ready? Troopers stared at me. I forced myself to laugh. That's no answer. Are you ready to fight? Yeah, we're ready. A few troopers grumbled. That's it? I asked. What are you, a bunch of pansies? Let me hear you roar. We're ready, a few more said, pumping their fists into the air. These lohars nuked us, I shouted. They raped our world and tried to stamp humanity out of existence. Now's our chance to slam their heads against the wall so we can stomp on their faces. We're giving them payback times ten. Kill them, Dimitri shouted. Kill them bastards! Kill, 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 I chanted. Kill the bastards! The troopers took up my chant. It was primitive in the extreme. I suppose if N7 listened in, he would think himself superior to us. I expect the Starkians might understand. They had turned into hooting chimpanzees a couple of times during the strategy session. I would have led the troopers into another round of shouting, but the maneuvering became crazy, throwing us this way and that in our assault seats. If we hadn't been strapped in, we'd have twenty or more troopers with broken arms and legs. Get ready! I roared as I felt my voice strain in the back of my throat. We're getting near to unloading! Make sure you're channeled into your maniple's frequency! Three minutes later, a line appeared to the side in a bulkhead. It was a gap, a rent from something, shrapnel or a hot beam. Air howled out, and for the first time, some of us could see what was going on outside. The bad news was that three troopers hadn't sealed their helmets properly. They died. The first Earther casualties that I knew about. I spent the next minute yelling at everyone to check their suits. Look! Rollo said suddenly. I glanced at him. He pointed at the rent. We could see through it now. Bright flashing beams nearly blinded me. Then I caught a glimpse of the forerunner object in the distance. It gleamed white and seemed unearthly. What is that? Rollo whispered. I swallowed uneasily. What if the Lohars were right? What if this was holy ground and the first ones... Who were the first ones? Why did these artifacts matter so much that an entire Lohar legion had dedicated their lives to guarding it? Were the Jelk true devils? Was the beginning of the Bible, where Lucifer and his fallen angels rebelled, a storybook about an ancient space war? A terrible chill worked up my spine. No, no, I whispered to myself. If the Lohars were the angels... Why had they tried to annihilate humanity? That made them devils, demons. Get ready to debark, N7 said in our helmets. You heard the man, the android, I amended. This is it. 
We've practiced this before. Second man, you're driving the sleds. Good luck and good hunting, assault troopers. I lost sight of the artifact because our assault ship shifted position. I told myself not to think crazy thoughts of angels, demons, and God. We were the assault troopers come to do battle against genocidal aliens. That's all that mattered for the next few hours. Actually, winning mattered. Because if we lost, I didn't think cloth would keep on using humanity. That meant extinction for us. Think about payback, I whispered. Debark now, N7 said. You must attack the enemy. Chapter 15 Assault Ship 6 opened up, and the sleds waited along the lower sides. I tore off my seat buckles and used magnetic traction to clank to my sled. The sled was a simple vehicle, a long plank with thrusters on the bottom and skidoo-like handlebars in front. It boasted a small railgun in front. I demagnetized the boots and shoved off, floating to sled Zeno 212. A twist of my head showed me that my squad followed. As I closed on the sled, I focused, landing, strapping in and revving the thrusters to life. The sled shuddered as the other troopers landed and strapped in. The seconds ticked by and the space battle went on around us. It was sickeningly glorious and beautiful. What can I say? The forerunner artifact, the Taurus, the big silver donut, gleamed with an amazing radiance. We orbited the object at the same velocity as the small asteroids and sand clusters. I tried to get a mental fix on the artifact's size. If the nearest asteroid was a mile in diameter... I gazed at the artifact. It had to be bigger than the Lohar ship that had beamed my dad. Maybe that thing was three times larger. I raised my left arm, shielding my visor, my eyesight. Something was in the middle of the artifact. This is truly amazing, Ella said through the helmet comm. What's that? I asked. I believe a tiny black hole is in the exact center of the artifact, Ella said. How is that possible? My throat was tight enough. This made it worse. I swallowed, and I heard N7 give the all clear. It's go time, I said. This is it, boys. I gave the sled thrust, and we slipped away from Assault Ship 6. We headed for the nearest asteroid, aiming at the domes there with their open bay doors. A single cannon tube in the nearest dome kept erupting with a milky ray. I followed it with my gaze and witnessed an assault ship disintegrating in space. They're killing our guys with that beam, Rollo said over the helmet comm. Well, they can, I growled. Well, they can. I applied more thrust, but it felt like we crawled toward the asteroid. The trip gave me time to swivel my head and take in the gigantic scene. All around this portion of holy space, assault ships moved in like sharks. I didn't see any Starkian vessels. I imagine I couldn't without a radar screen or something similar. They must be too far back. As far as I could see, space was flooded with assault ships and sleds. It reminded me of the movie Avengers, when the aliens slipped down out of the wormholes and launched down into New York City. We swarmed the Lohar Fifth Legion, and by the number of aimlessly drifting and destroyed assault ships, sleds, and individual troopers, the Lohars were already taking a frightful toll of us. This is like an amphibious landing only in space. I said. My old man told me once that amphibious landings almost always have the deadliest results for the invaders, Rollo said. Where are you? I asked. I'm to your right. At your two o'clock, Rollo said. I glanced back, and Rollo waved at me as he piloted his sled. Farther back, Dimitri directed his sled. To my left, Ella brought the rest of our maniple. Each sled carried four passengers and the driver. I took a deep breath through my nostrils. 
There was absolutely nothing fancy about this. We drove straight down into their guns. They slaughtered us, and the Lohars would have annihilated everyone if Starkian missiles hadn't finally streaked ahead and given us some covering fire, exploding into nuclear fireballs on the asteroids. Several things happened then. The first, and maybe the most ominous. The artifact gleamed even brighter with a daunting glow. I expected to hear heavenly singing next. Would angels with flaming swords appear? Man, but I didn't like the forerunner object. It frightened me. The second thing to occur took my mind off that. Powerful radiation from the warhead struck us. I could feel leakage through my biosuit, and my bones ached. My mouth tasted like copper and other metals. Our own side is trying to kill us, Dimitri groaned. I laughed, and once more, as in Antarctica, the laughter didn't sound totally sane to my ears. We're still breathing, I said, even if it hurts. The dome that had been slaughtering nearby sleds looked like shredded junk. One rounded wall had a single long shard jutting up, and even as I studied it, the tip toppled and fell out of sight. That was one point for the Starkians. It took a slow and agonizing ten more minutes to reach the first asteroid. I could have turned the sled around and applied braking thrust. I didn't believe we could afford even that. I'd seen single ships, the Lohar variety, swarming from inner asteroids coming to aid their brethren. So I aimed my sled at another dome low on the asteroid's horizon, and I shouted, Get ready to jump and break! Rollo and Dimitri were doing the same thing. Ella believed in doing it by the book and lagged behind as she slowed for a sled landing. Now! I shouted, shoving up and off. My squad did likewise. The sled's thruster kicked in and the small craft blasted for the farther dome. It never made it, as a milky ray from the dome disintegrated the craft. Break and get low, I said. We'll be safe from the domes on the surface. I remembered that from the strategy meeting. It was one of the few useful tidbits I'd gained from the Starkians. Jets of thrust expelled from our packs. We slowed, and I landed first, my boots touching down onto the rocky soil. Soon my squad lay on the surface with me. I gathered the maniple, studied the situation, and decided we should sweep toward the destroyed dome and learn what we could about the Lohar layout. We practiced the low-gravity gliding learned on Io and Karen. I would have liked to be home in the solar system right now. The Forerunner artifact continued to glow and radiate strangely. I no longer looked at it, although I was much too aware of it in my peripheral vision. We beat the Fifth Legion reinforcements to the shattered Lohar Dome. The shards of the thing looked like diamonds. Its controls seemed to be plant-like bulbs. Freaking weird stuff here, Rollo said. Look, Ella said over the helmet comm. I found a Lohar body. Everyone scrambled to her. Ella stood beside a seven-foot suited creature with tiger features. The Lohars, if that's who this was, had a humanoid shape. This one lacked a tail. Natural predators, Ella said. I imagine they are ferocious foot soldiers. Makes it surprising, then, that they'd use bioterminators on us on Earth, I said. What is your reasoning? Ella asked. If they're natural predators, warriors, I said, wouldn't they prefer to fight it out instead of using poison? An interesting thesis, Ella said. It looks like we're going to test how good of warriors they are real soon, Rollo said. Dimitri just radioed. A couple of enemy platoons are on their way here. With the warning, I tried to set up an ambush. Maybe the biosuits helped and made us harder to spot on radar. Did the Lohars use personal sets? It might have helped us if we did. We engaged them among some low peaks behind the shattered dome. In our firing line, and from behind rocks and low trenches, 
we beamed with our lasers. The Lohars wore powered armor, or something like it. There must have been forty against our twenty. The ambush worked after a fashion. We cut down five, maybe six Lohars, the first volley. The enemy went to ground or to the surface, and we found ourselves in a bitter gunfight. They fired RPG-like missiles and a white ray akin to what beamed from their domes. A touch of a ray curled a trooper's biosuit, exposing human skin to space. Violent decompression killed the trooper before the suit could repair itself. Blood drifted in a mist as the man collapsed. A Lohar single ship zoomed overhead, and from it, a legionary beamed down at us, taking out three of my troopers fast. From on my back, and with help from several others, we destroyed the single ship, firing upward. It gave the Lohars on the surface time to close with us. They were big, and there were more of them, and these were elite soldiers. Without our pulse grenades, they would have won. I and the others used the highest setting and threw. The pulses blew powerfully in purple explosions, as if we were high on an LSD trip. The explosives shredded the Lohar battlesuits. Even so, I lost two-thirds of the maniple. Fortunately, other maniples landed, joining me, and we low-glided across the rocky surface for the next dome. This time it was the Lohar turn to ambush us. Luckily, we had a few hot shots on our side, using their sleds as the enemies had used their single ship like close air support. The sleds' rail guns blasted battlesuits, but one by one, the Lohars destroyed the sleds. We lost half our troopers, but we beat the ambushing team, destroying every tiger daring to face us. Death abounded, and it should have worried me and the troopers, but the biosuits pumped us up with something pouring killing lust into our bloodstreams. I felt elated, and more than eager to finish it with these low-hard giants. Much of the fight became a blur of action, of targeting and beaming alien butchers. We reached the next Lohar dome and broke in with our pulse grenades. It shouldn't have happened, but I think we caught some of the Lohar dome gunners by surprise. In an orgy of bloodshed, we killed the tigers, as we began calling them, and successfully opened up the first asteroid to the invasion. That's when it happened, perhaps several minutes after our victory. I'm still not sure about the timing of it. Crete, you gotta come and take a look at this, Rollo told me over the helmet comm. I sat slumped in a corner against some Lohar machinery. My bones and joints pulsed with radiation pain. Once we returned to the battle jumpers, we'd all have to spend time in the healing tanks to repair cellular damage. What is it? I asked. What's got you so excited? The artifact, Rollo said. Something is happening to it. You gotta come look, because it's too hard to explain. I don't want to look at it, I said. The glowing earlier gave me the creeps. No, you gotta come see this, Rollo insisted. The Lohars are retreating to it, and the thing is becoming fainter by the second. I groaned as I stood and float-jumped for an exit. I joined Rollo and Ella on a low hill to the rear of the dome. We looked toward the center of the swarming junk orbiting the Taurus. The Forerunner artifact glowed with an unearthly light, but even more so than earlier. I shuddered, and I'm not sure why. Look! Ella said as she pointed at the artifact center. What am I supposed to be seeing? I asked. The black hole appears to have widened, to have grown, Ella said. How can you tell? I asked. I am a scientist. I am trained to observe and notice the details. I'd have to take her word for it. It looked no different to me. What I found impressive was the streaming line of flying Lohar legionaries and single ships. There was one bigger, bloated vessel. I saw a single ship land on top of it and zoom off seconds later. Was that a fuel tanker? A mothership? From all directions, they fled the asteroids and headed inward toward the artifact. 
I thought the Lohars would be like World War II Japanese, fighting to the bitter end and making kamikaze charges at us. These were elite religious troopers, and they were fleeing already. That didn't make sense. What do you think the artifact is doing? Rollo asked. Maybe the Lohars know how to make it detonate, I said. If they can't have it, nobody can. No, Ella said. Do you have an idea what's going on? I asked. I do, Ella said. Well, how about spilling it for us, Einstein? I asked. Ella remained silent as she watched, with a small smile on her face. I watched her for a moment, but finally, almost against my will, I studied the giant artifact. It grew fainter, as if it was in the process of disappearing. Then I'd swear I could see the stars behind it. This was getting weird. Should we go back inside the dome? Rollo asked nervously. Why? I asked. Black holes and disappearing ancient forerunner artifacts seem like they might pump out gamma or x-rays or who knows what kind of radiation at us, Rollo said. I'd like more shielding. You're right, I said. Let's get behind some cover. You're too late, Ella said. It is happening just as I thought it would. I swallowed uneasily. I'd been seeing plenty of strange things these past weeks. Why should a faint forerunner artifact matter? It did. And I can't tell you why, because I don't know myself. One moment, the giant Taurus became fainter yet, so we could hardly see the outlines. And then, it was gone. The Lohars near the object vanished with it. The rest, streaming toward the departed artifact, kept advancing. Had the thing teleported elsewhere, been destroyed? What had just happened? I didn't know. Was this supposed to happen? Rollo asked. Is this what Cloth was really shooting for? I shrugged, then I turned to Ella. You're the Einstein. You seem to know what happened. Did it disappear? Do you mean go invisible? Ella asked in an amused manner. Let's not play twenty questions, I said. Where did it go? As to that, I cannot say, Ella told us. The clue is the black hole in the center. Amazing technology to hold such a thing in place. I would not have believed this unless I had seen it myself. Yeah, why's that? I asked. What causes the jump roots? Ella asked. Why are they there? What's that have to do with the forerunner artifact? I asked. Are jump roots a natural phenomenon? Ella asked in a rhetorical way. Are they folds in space, oddities caused through natural occurrences? Or were the jump roots created? Why does it make any difference? I asked. Ella faced me. It makes all the difference. If jump roots are artificial... Are you suggesting the forerunner artifact made the jump roots? I asked. Ah, you're a clever thinker, Ella said. The black hole is the giveaway, isn't it? Yeah, sure, I said. It is my belief that the artifact slipped away through a wormhole, Ella said. Then why don't we see evidence of the wormhole? I asked. A reasonable question, Ella said. Yes. Why aren't the rest of the Lohars sucked into a wormhole? It is an interesting question. Pop goes the thesis? I asked. Not necessarily, Ella said. If I had monitoring equipment... Just a minute, I said. N7 is hailing me on the command channel. Using my chin, I clicked a pad inside the helmet. The smooth-skinned android appeared in the HUD of my visor. He seemed to be sitting at the controls of Assault Ship 6. You must gather those under your command, N7 said. The Lohars are returning to the maze.
You're retrieving us? I asked. On the contrary, N7 said. You must gather your troopers and move deeper into the maze. You must destroy the remaining Lohars before they can regain their positions on the inner asteroids. That doesn't make sense, I said. The artifact is gone. This isn't holy ground anymore. So pick us up and have the Starkians blast the asteroids into rubble, killing Lohars. It'll be like shooting fish in a barrel. They can slaughter the Fifth Legion. That is an interesting proposal, N7 said. You mean no one else has thought of it yet? I asked. Come on! Why waste human lives and why waste time? Pick us up and let the Starkians deal with them. Our battle's won. Await my word, N7 said. I must speak to Nagagobo concerning your suggestion. The android vanished from my HUD. So what's up? Rollo asked as I turned toward them. High Command is trying to figure out what to do next, I said. The fight's over, right? Rollo asked. As a savant, I asked Ella, do you think the artifact will reappear here? Hmm, Ella said. I hadn't considered that. In truth, I lack enough data to make a rational prediction. My instincts tell me no, but it might be possible. Yeah, I said to myself. I liked Ella's original explanation about the artifact because it helped dampen my own ideas. The way the artifact had glowed and then grown fainter, it had seemed too much like a stellar ghost or a flying Dutchman. The thing had seemed supernatural there at the end. That's something I hadn't expected from aliens in outer space. I didn't want it to be supernatural. Black holes, wormholes, jump roots. Give me rational and reasonable explanations. I'd once read something by Stephen King, or the author explaining how one of the truly most scary things would be for a rock to suddenly start talking to you. It would freak you out, right? Because rocks aren't supposed to talk. Well, forerunner artifacts made by first ones who, in reality, had been angels from heaven would freak you out, too. I disliked that line of reasoning and preferred Ella's hard science approach. It fit my view of reality better. N7 appeared on my HUD. It was hard to tell, but he seemed grim. His thin lips were downturned. I'd never seen that before. You must continue the assault, the android told me. The victory... Hey, guess what? I asked. The object we came to collect is gone, kaput, disappeared. There isn't any more victory to be won because we've already won. Your logic is faulty, N7 said. Much of the Fifth Legion remains. You must slaughter them. That is the criteria for victory. Oh, right. Sure, what was I thinking? I asked. Their holy object is gone, and now who knows what kind of righteous wrath is pulsating through their tiger veins. No, my plastic friend, now it is time to use the Gatling guns. Your reference fails me, N7 said. That didn't surprise me. The Gatling guns were human in origin from the last colonial era. American Indians in the Midwest and African tribesmen had each in turn charged Gatling guns, often in a howling mob. Sometimes they had been holy warriors, given heavy mojo by their shamans to protect them from the industrial man's bullets. The mojo always failed against a stream of lead, particularly those hosed from the then ultra-modern Gatling gun. That was the trick, hosing lead. The Gatling guns were the first machine guns. What I was saying to N7 was that it was time to forget about hand-to-hand -hand or visor-to-visor ground-pounding and start hosing the enemy with high-tech weaponry. I didn't want to lose any more humans in a useless fight. Does Nagagobo still have a problem bringing his ships near the maze to blast the Lohars to bits? I asked. Yes, N7 said. I could understand it before, I said. But not once the artifact is gone. 
The object could always return, N7 said. Does Nagagobo know this to be possible? He believes it. The artifact has done this before? I asked. Nagagobo has declared the object's vanishing as a miracle, N7 said. He cannot destroy the maze as it witnessed the miracle. The maze is made of rocks and sand, I said. They can't witness anything. Nagagobo believes otherwise, N7 said. However, his wording may indicate Starkian idioms that I do not precisely comprehend. Okay, look, I said. Pick us up and use the assault ships to attack the Fifth Legion. The assault ships have defensive weaponry, but they're still a lot more powerful than our laser rifles and pulse grenades. Besides, I bet we've already taken heavy losses. Human casualties do not matter, N7 said. You were brought here to fight. You must continue the attack. I laughed at him. Human casualties certainly mattered to the humans. I told him, I doubt your troops are going to do much advancing at the moment. You must instruct your maniple and the others to... Listen to me, N7, I said. Try to use your logic circuits. I have a bio-brain, not circuits. Okay, okay, don't get technical on me. Your neurons, then, if that makes you happy. Just listen for a minute. Cloth didn't structure our little army with higher commanders, just the maniple first men. We knew the score, though. Storm the Forerunner artifact and kill every alien defending it or on it. But the object disappeared, right? Now everyone is going to hunker down. If you... If Cloth had made higher levels of command, those commanders could order the troopers back into action. But no one is going to listen to another first man telling them what to do. The object's disappearance changed everything. That doesn't have to ruin the secondary battle plan. Killing Lohar legionaries. Pick us up and maneuver nuclear missiles at the Lohars while they're trying to get back to the safety of the asteroids. You have an open window to destroy them without taking any loss in return, but you gotta move quickly to do it. Naga Gobo, listen to me, N7. You have command authority over the assault boats. Use that authority. Force those baboons, the Starkians, into doing what's smart. Don't let their superstitions cost cloth profits. There is merit to your words, N7 said. But I distrust your motives. You are the android killer. Perhaps you're telling me these things in order to trick me. If you're afraid I can outsmart you... It is not a matter of fear, N7 said. I have a far greater IQ than you. There you go, I said. It isn't rational that I can outthink you. Therefore, for you to act as if I could is irrational. Cloth loves profits. Outfitting and training mercenaries cost money. The Jelk wishes a solid return on his investment. Don't get his property killed, especially as there is no longer a profit motive reason for doing so. I must admit that your logic is impeccable, N7 said. I'll add one more factor, I said. Too many maniples have become mixed up on our asteroid. I bet it's the same way all over this maze. That means some assault troopers will drift too far away from their boats. If they drift too far, that will cause their obedience chip to explode and kill them, and for no profitable reason. N7 stared at me. He held that pose for several seconds. Finally, he gave a sharp, severe nod. Prepare for pickup, he said. The Forerunner object is gone. Its presence made the space holy. Now it is gone, and so should be the Starkian inhibitions to using nuclear weapons in the inner area. If they cannot see reason, the androids will destroy the remaining Lohars and win Shakloth's favor. Now you're thinking, I said. The HUD winked out without N7 even saying thank you. But that was okay. I'd saved human lives, and that's all that mattered. Too bad I hadn't foreseen Cloth's reaction. Chapter 16
We boarded the assault ship, and the sides closed up as if they were giant tarantula legs. That sealed us in, except for one spot. The wall there moved several times until the slot jammed into its proper place. The rent in the bulkhead had a metal patch over it, so we couldn't peek outside any longer. Pretty smooth ride, Rollo said after a time. I'd been dozing due to battle fatigue. The biosuits no longer amped us up, and the hours of pre-battle jitters had finally demanded their payment of sleep. What's that? I asked, lifting my head. I said it's a pretty smooth ride for us maneuvering through the asteroid maze, Rollo said. There's nothing but continuous acceleration. It makes me think we're heading for a jump route or mothership, not the slaughter legionaries. And seven, I said, using a special channel to call him. There was nothing, though. Despite repeated hails, the android didn't respond. I think you're right, I told Rollo. The hunt is over and the hounds are locked up. I wonder what it is about us that gives the aliens such a low opinion of humans, Rollo asked. I'd wondered about the same thing, and I had a possible reason. My guess is arrogance, I said. They have high technology, and we don't. Therefore, to them, we're beasts. That doesn't make sense, Rollo said. It did to the European explorers to the New World, I said. They saw Indians running around in breech clouts and moccasins, firing stone-tipped arrows. Some of the more bigoted Europeans wondered if Indians even possessed souls. That's calling them beasts after a fashion. Non-humans. And that was just humans seeing other humans of a slightly different color and facial features. Now imagine what it's like for aliens seeing other aliens, especially those down on their luck, like us. We lack their high tech, their mechanical sophistication, and therefore to them we're animals. Aren't aliens supposed to be better than that? Rollo asked. Why should they be any better? I asked. They're different, certainly. But the idea aliens were automatically going to be morally superior to humans is ludicrous. I'm referring to movies like E.T. or Close Encounters. What I find amazing is that we even have enough similar thoughts or ideas to work together. But I'll tell you the one thing I've noticed. It seems to me the one constant to having higher intelligence is arrogance. You remember the smart kids from high school? Especially in the areas they cared about, like video games or a super guitarist in music class. The best in any of those areas was always looking down his nose at the lesser players. The aliens are intelligent, and they see that their tech is obviously better than ours. Therefore, they're arrogant about it. Maybe that's the one norm throughout the universe. High intelligence equals high arrogance. Rollo grunted thoughtfully. And I'll tell you something else, I said. That's what gives us our fighting chance. Alien arrogance? Rollo asked. Yep, I said. Arrogance usually brings blind spots. We can't afford arrogance because we're about as down as we can be. Okay, let them kick us for now if that makes them arrogant. We'll use their blind spots against them to climb up from our low position. I would have said more, but just then we jumped. That ended all conversations, and it proved Rollo had been right about us leaving the battle area. After the jump, no one felt like talking anymore. Radiation poisoning had kicked in hard. Even the biosuits must have felt it. Some of them oozed off their wearers, including me. In the end, the androids brought us back to the Jelk battle jumpers. In a giant hangar bay, we filed off the assault ship and trudged back to the mercenary area of the ship. From there, most of us went to the healing tanks. I floated for hours, and I swallowed the big green pills they gave us. I could feel each one sliding down my throat. It made me feel like a dog with worms. Afterward, I slept for hours, woke up, took another green pill, drank water like a horse, and went back to sleep. 
It took several cycles of that before my bones stopped hurting and breathing felt normal. I'd smelled smoke before that, as if each individual nostril hair had been singed. It had been a week and a half since the Forerunner battle. I was surprised we hadn't heard anything concerning consequences so far. I figured Cloth would have berated us for something, and I had been thinking about what I would say to him. Rollo and I sat in the cafeteria playing cards. He took a card from the deck, put the card in his hand, studied them, looked up, widened his eyes enough so I noticed and cleared his throat. Without turning around, I knew Rollo must see an android approaching. It had been taking too long for them to say something. Like I said, I'd been expecting a visit for days. With my back to the android, I said, Hello, N7. Silence greeted me. I glanced at Rollo before turning around. The android stood there in cyber armor and with a pistol strapped to his side. How did you know I approached? N7 asked. Through elementary deduction, I said. Did you hear my footsteps? No, you were walking too quietly for that. Precisely, N7 said. Nor did I hear your second man warn you. Are you sure about that? Yes. I've been observing him since entering the cafeteria. Sorry to disappoint you, I said. But Rollo did warn me. He drew a card and... Ah, N7 said. The cough was a prearranged signal. No, it was just a cough. Well, not just a cough, but it hadn't been prearranged. I see that I must refine my studies on human communications, N7 said. I still have more to learn. Why bother? I asked. Interesting, N7 said. You're attempting to elicit information. I recognize the technique, as I've been studying the various recordings of you. It has been quite profitable. I have found that you are a crafty beast. You play act the part of a ruffian, but I've come to see that all the while you scheme most cunningly. What recordings are you talking about? I asked. You already know. The woman gave you a warning. In recording B-2418, I clearly heard her tell you. I scowled for a moment before asking. Do you mean Jennifer? Precisely, N7 said. I set my cards face down on the table. I noticed the top card had a tiny mark on the back, an extra line in all those swirls. Had someone been marking cards? Ignoring that, I wondered about Jennifer. I hadn't thought about her for some time. Where is she? I asked. On Earth, I presume? N7 grew still as he studied me. You're showing heightened interest in her whereabouts. Is this because you wish to mate with her? Are you studying humans or me? I asked. Both. N7 said. You still haven't answered the question as to why you bother. I am not here to answer your questions. I am here to escort you to Shah Cloth. Oh, I said. So I'm finally going to meet him in person. If I had humor conditioning, N7 said, I believe this would be the moment for me to laugh. No, I am escorting you to a screening chamber. Why doesn't Cloth meet me in person? He is displeased with you. That's his reason? Negative, N7 said. I am not responding to your query as to why he declines a face-to-face -face encounter. Instead, I am informing you that as of this moment, he is displeased with you personally. How come? N7 hesitated. It almost seemed like a human reaction. Then the android glanced at Rollo before fixing his solemn gaze back on me. Shah Cloth is also unhappy with me. I believe he thinks you have a corrupting influence. Because you used the assault ships to attack the Fifth Legion? I asked. 
you are operating under faulty information. After the artifact's disappearance, neither I nor the other androids flew deeper into the maze. We retreated for the Starkey and Mother ships. And that's why Cloth is unhappy? Negative, N7 said. The Starkians complained about our actions. They lost ships. Yes, the Starkians lost ships, I said, trying to prod him along. In a most insulting manner, N7 said. Nagagobo barely accepted my explanation as to why we retreated from the maze. His problem was that although he clearly desired to, he could not refute the logic you had shown me. Eventually, he launched missiles, but because of his tardiness in responding, it took too long to pulverize the outer asteroids for his ships to get near the inner ones. Therefore, he brought heavier ships to bear, beam ships, bringing them to the edge of the maze. It was at that point the Lokars launched their surprise. Suicidal single ships. Nagagobo lost critical Starkian vessels. Because of that, he demanded heavy restitution from Shah Cloth. So this is about profits? Negative, N7 said. This is about expenditures without sufficient return. The Forerunner artifact assault proved a costly failure. As we failed to capture the object, Shah Cloth blames us, the N-series androids. Through impeccable logic, I have tried to show him the blame justifiably belongs on you. Thanks a lot, I said. N7 shook his head. Thanking me is not reasonable, especially as Shah Cloth is considering abandoning the Earth Beast project. If he decides to do so, he will jettison the humans on Earth and likely sell you fighting beasts, hoping to recoup the loss your training entailed. He may even sell you at bargain prices, which means the Starkians may buy you. The baboons need assault troops? I can only assume your faulty reasoning lies in your lack of data, N7 said. Because of his critical ship losses, Nagagobo needs scapegoats. You and your earth beasts would do. He hopes to expiate his sins by sacrificing you before the Starkian Grand Council. It would be an agonizing end, and I'm told very shameful for you humans. Crucifixion, I told Rollo. N7 stood silently for a moment as if processing data. Yes, that is an apt analogy. Unlike the Jelk, the Starkians believe suffering can atone for bitter setbacks. To a Jelk, such a concept is unthinkable. Money alone can pay for failure. I gotta say, N7, you're a wealth of information. What an odd way to say it. Wealth of information. Your Earth idioms are often strange. If it's any consolation, I find you, Cloth, and the Starkians to be pretty strange, too. You are in the inferior position, N7 said. Thus, it is foolish to make verbal value judgments concerning your betters. You could be right. The thing is, I find it helps my peace of mind to call a spade a spade. I don't like to wear blinders or to pretend. I didn't like it back on Earth, the PC crowd, and I don't like it out here in space either. PC? N7 asked. It doesn't matter, I said. Cloth wants to see me, is that right? To see us both, N7 said. Come along, I have already dallied here too long. I got up and followed the android down miles of corridors. In the end, I found myself sitting on a metal chair before what must have been the same table as earlier. In moments, the wall screen flickered and I saw cloth in an entirely new setting. The red-skinned jelk lounged in a vat of steaming purple liquid. In one hand, he held an hourglass-shaped container filled with a foamy yellow drink. In the other hand, he gripped a clicker. Softly discordant music played in the background while beautifully naked women, human women, moved around him. The women wore strings of jingling jewelry on their throats, hips, and ankles, which only heightened their desirability. I see you've noticed the females, Cloth said. 
I nodded, also noticing something else. The difference between the women and the jelk. Cloth was the size of an evil rumple stiltskin. He couldn't be any taller than three and a half feet. It was shock. Until now, I'd considered him normal-sized. But then I'd had nothing to compare him with. Maybe that's why he'd been interviewing me via screen. For safety's sake. If I had acquired the Forerunner artifact, Cloth was saying, you and your troopers would be reclining at ease now and enjoying these sex objects. I swallowed, watching the lovely movements of the ladies. A pendant stirred between one woman's large breasts. I couldn't tear my eyes from her nipples. Sight of them had definitely caught me by surprise. Then I scowled. Were they Earth women or androids? If from Earth they were slaves to an alien. I found myself hating the fact an alien had captured and enslaved them. We defeated the Fifth Legion, I said. We drove them from their asteroid maze. We did our part as requested. So I don't see that you have any reason to be unhappy with us. Let me correct your error, Cloth said. You defeated the forward fortress areas, but you did not complete the mission as ordered. We fought hard enough that we panicked the rest of the Legion, I said. Why otherwise did they flee their inner strongholds and race for the artifact? Cloth took a sip of his drink, soon slurping it dry. He beckoned a woman, handing her the glass. She hurried away with jingling sounds, and I noticed the jelk watching the woman with a lustful eye. We performed better than you'd expected, I said. Slowly, Cloth tore his gaze from the woman and regarded me. I have a theory concerning the odd Lohar behavior. The Fifth Legion must have become stale. Perhaps they rested on their reputation and became lax in training. Either that, I said, or Earth troops beat the shit out of them and the rest panicked. The rest were unwilling to face such savage troopers in combat. Cloth grinned in a mocking way. You bask in illusions. If the Lukars were so terrified of you, why did they return to the battlefield? No. In the end, you earth beasts ran from them. I shook my head. The Forerunner artifact vanished, turning the attack into a feudal exercise. Cloth frowned. You would do well not to openly remind me of your failure. I slapped the metal table and laughed. Cloth's frown turned into a scowl. I am not Nagagobo, nor am I a Saurian or an errant android. I am the Jelk, the paymaster of seven battle jumpers. Without me, humanity fades into the dark night of oblivion. Forget that and you and your ilk will die. His threat sobered me. I haven't forgotten, I said. See that you do not. Cloth snapped his fingers. Like that, the freighters will head into space, ridding themselves of unprofitable cargoes. It was galling, particularly seeing the women enthrall to him. In truth, I was just as much enthralled to cloth as they were. But it was different, because my hard wiring made it that way. How much of human behavior was rationally decided versus an inner biological need? Babies naturally sucked. They didn't consciously decide to. At two, they turned into hellions. At fourteen or fifteen, they became rebels against parental authority, and somewhere in their twenties, most got married. None decided to live in trees the rest of their lives or build nests like a wasp. Were those logical decisions or biologically hardwired, determined? I turned away from the screen and drummed my fingers on the table. 
What had happened to the vengeance-driven maniac in Antarctica who charged onto an alien lander? His freaks had come down and wrecked our world. Now the oh-so-mighty and puffed-up cloth blithely threatened me with human extinction if I didn't jump high enough when he uttered the word. And it was time to eat crow and time to plot. I faced the screen and bowed my head. I'd like to respectfully point out that the assault troopers could have done nothing differently to halt the vanishing artifact. It is the single point in your favor keeping me from flushing you all out of the hangar bays, Cloth said. Didn't we do well in driving the Lohars from their outer asteroids? I asked. You showed ferocity, that's true. But this disobedience to orders... I have yet to decide how to punish you beasts, so you understand that another such incident will end in your deaths. I sat quietly, with my head bowed. Still, Cloth said, on an individual basis, you did prove yourselves the equal of a Lohar legionary. It proved my thesis correct in initially coming to Earth. Unfortunately, there was too much wastage in bringing you beasts into combat range with the Legion. The wastage incurred heavy profit losses. I looked up. May I inquire as to battle casualties? Do you note the beasts' behavioral differences? Cloth asked N7. I do, sir, N7 said. It is impressive. Never bargain with them, Cloth said. It only leads them to believe they are your equal. Always remember that the beasts are cunning and egotistical. They are quick to sense indecision. Observe how Creed Beast has seen my steel glove. He understands my threats and instantly modifies his behavior accordingly. Your handling of him is quite instructive, sir. N7 said. With a single hand, Cloth splashed purple liquid. He appeared thoughtful, and soon said, Perhaps I am partly at fault for this disaster. With the new upgrades, I had thought you N-series androids cleverer than you actually are. I wonder now how costly further upgrades would be in order to bring you into the needed intelligence range to properly handle the beasts. I have debated sending you back to the mines, all of you, and letting Saurians take your places. Yes, sir, N7 said. We deserve no better. That is correct, Cloth said. You do not deserve anything, as you are my constructs, to do with as I please. But I am not driven by thoughts of vengeance, such as a Starkian contractor feels. Profits alone interest me. I have sunk sizable funds into your combined upgrades, into the Earth Beast bio suits and training, and into hiring a Starkian raider fleet. This artifact. Cloth accepted a refilled glass from a kneeling woman, taking a healthy swallow and wiping yellow foam from his lips. Fortunately, the artifact's vanishing has upset many in the Jade League. I have already heard word of violent debates among the leading League theologians. It appears none of them knows where the artifact went. At least, so say my spies. This may be the perfect time to strike at Sigma Draconis. Yes, sir, N7 said. The beasts fought valiantly, Cloth said, which I predicted they would do. How can I foresee the artifacts vanishing? Am I a theologian? Am I a savant on forerunner technology? Who among the Jelk and their customers understands these ancient devices? Was the Jelk drunk? Even as I wondered, Cloth took another gulp of the yellow drink. The fortresses of Sigma Draconis, Cloth said. And the Guardian fleet there, those are the things a civilized Jelk understands. 
the jump routes into Sigma Draconis, if we could gain the star system, the entire Draconis subset would fall to us. These theological debates. Clough laughed, exposing his pointy teeth. I must speak with Axel Ox. If I combined his battle jumpers with mine and with the Starkian fleet, hmm, and if I could persuade Dujay Lark to commit to the endeavor, Cloth's eyes narrowed as he studied me. Your success against the outer asteroids is what propels my thoughts towards Sigma Draconis. It is a heavily fortified Lohar star system, but it is far from their regular sphere of influence. It is the critical nexus point splintering important corporation areas into several unequal zones. With an opening of the Sigma Draconis route, corporation vessels would no longer need to pay the Star Alliance tariff. That would bring a 20% decrease in my hauler fees. Cloth drained the glass, tossing the container into the steaming vat. Droplets splashed upward plunking back into the liquid like heavy raindrops. He grinned at me, and he triggered the clicker at the woman. One by one, they dropped onto the steam-slickened tiles, groaned and writhed so their jewelry clinked. Obedience chips must have been embedded in their lovely necks. I caught him slyly glancing at me as the women twisted on the floor. His dark eyes were shiny, and a little grin twitched at the corners of his lips. I knew what he wanted from me. Arrogance, I told myself. This was about arrogance. I needed to feed his so he remained blind to certain realities. Stop it! I shouted, as if desperate. Cloth's shiny eyes gleamed. Why should I stop? I find their motions delightfully erotic and stimulating. Don't you? Torturing them is inhuman, I said with false anguish. They're but beasts, he said. I forced myself to lick my lips as if anxious. Why needlessly torment them? How— This was difficult to say. How does torturing them help them to serve you better? I want you to notice this, N7, Cloth said. Creed Beast has an emotional attachment to human females in distress. Isn't that interesting? Yes, sir, N7 said. I hadn't foreseen that. I'd thought him more logical than emotion-driven. Once more, Cloth clicked the device, and then he made a shooing motion. Panting, sweaty women picked themselves off the tiles and hurried out of the chamber, some of them weeping. Beasts are easy to control once you understand their motivations, Cloth told N7. And that is a good thing for you, he told me. Otherwise, your actions in the Altair system would force me to destroy you. You disobeyed direct orders to continue the assault. There was a military reason for our decision, I said. No, Cloth said. It wasn't a beast's decision to make. Against a straightforward directive, you failed to obey and failed to advance. What is more, you convinced my android to heed your wishes. I cannot understand such a thing. At the time, N7 said, his logic seemed impeccable. What logic? Cloth asked angrily. I have studied the assault in detail, sir, N7 said. The beasts acted bravely when they knew exactly what to do. During the initial assault, they knew their orders. Afterward, they were unable to react as a coordinated whole, and it proved their undoing. I almost glanced at N7. His words surprised me. Did the android have ulterior motives? He would seem to be arguing for building larger battle formations such as companies and battalions, instead of only having maniples. Directing the beasts was your task, N7, Cloth said. You were supposed to coordinate their actions and motivate them with needed knowledge. 
but you proved unable to fulfill your duties. Yes, sir, I agree, N7 said. Not that you need my agreement. For your sake, Cloth said. I'm glad you understand that. Yes, sir, N7 said. I wonder, however, if beast troops respond well to intellectual rigor, to android logic. I wonder if they would respond more quickly to one of their own speaking their peculiar creature emotive language. Once more, Cloth's eyes seemed to shine. Are you suggesting we broaden the beast command structure? Yes, sir, N7 said. I have studied them. I believe they operate more smoothly if they feel a sense of loyalty and trust toward the higher commanders. I hope you're not suggesting we put this one in charge of the troops. No, sir, N7 said. This one appears to be more crafty than the others. He does not appear crafty to me, Cloth said. But then I am many times more intelligent than you androids. Perhaps if you gave me more upgrades now, sir, N7 said. Cloth laughed. This is intriguing. You are attempting to practice guile. It is an obvious attempt and therefore pathetic. No. You have all the upgrades I'm going to give you for the moment, N7. But I had already planned to broaden the assault procedures. The Earth Beast assaults were recklessly positive during the initial part of the battle. It is too bad they took over 50% casualties getting to the combat point of operation. I swallowed down a retort. Over 50% casualties meant that over 12,000 troopers had died in the Altair assault. That was obscene. The heavy casualties mean I'll have to spend more monies on training further Earth levies, Cloth said. His head swayed, and he blinked repeatedly, sinking lower into the purple liquid until his chin touched the surface water. I was sure now that Cloth was drunk, or whatever passed for drunk among the jelk. How many alien decisions had been made while under the influence of intoxicants? You will institute tests, N7, Cloth said. We need aggressive beasts in the leadership who fear me and desire rank at any cost. You might be better served into putting troopers into command positions that the assault troops already trust, I said. N7 told you as much. Are you attempting to instruct me? Cloth asked in a brittle voice. I believe I've given you faithful advice all along the line. In fact, sir, that was hard to say, and it galled me to call this evil Rumpelstiltskin sir. But I had to bend now so I could... I shook my head, not allowing myself to even think seditious thoughts while in Cloth's presence. What? What? Cloth asked as he splashed water. What's your point? By retreating when we did, I said, I preserved Earth troops for you. You don't need to train as many new recruits now, which should save you funds. Bah! What do you know about business practices? Cloth asked. You are an emotional, vicious creature. Who dearly wants to rise in rank, I said. Cloth laughed. Your artifice is so obvious, it fools no one. I've shown you I can fight. Now I want to win your favor in order to help the humans on Earth. I'd also like to help the females on your ship. You want to use them yourself, eh? Cloth asked, while leering at me, the corners of his mouth twitching with amusement. Yes, I said. The way they moved. I need a woman, and would like to earn one if I could. Hmm, Cloth said. Let me think about it. For now, perhaps you have a point. N7, take him back to the beast hold. 
I must unwind for a time so I can bend my thoughts to devising a winning scheme. These earth beasts drove out a Lohar legion. That is the salient fact. Yes, I must strike quickly before the League takes countermeasures at Sigma Draconis. The attack on Altair has upset the Jade theologians and thrown their leadership into turmoil. Perhaps that will be enough of an advantage for me to make the coup of a lifetime. I must think deeply indeed. Go! Take him away! Sight of his beastly stupidity makes it difficult to concentrate. Keep thinking that, I thought. Then N7 beckoned. I rose and followed the android out of the chamber. Chapter 17 The next ship day was back to training. Cloth couldn't let his mercenaries get dull, but needed them at peak efficiency. A restructured maniple, twelve of the troopers were others from equally shattered squads, donned biosuits. We went outside the battle jumper to a zero-G chamber. Building-sized cubes and pyramids floated in a vast area. There we fought against two maniples defending a red flag. Androids had set our laser rifles on low wattage, and they tampered with the living armor. A hit froze the suits leaving a trooper immobile. I led the maniple in a deception maneuver, and we froze thirty-seven defenders before the last of our side died in the mock combat. Three times I led my maniple against larger formations. We beat the other side the last time, even though they had three maniples of troopers. We fought new teams each battle, while we learned zero-G tricks. It was instructive and our performance might have gone a long way toward determining what happened several days later. Before I get to that, I should say something about my thought process during the grueling days of retraining. Whether it was while peeking around the base of a floating pyramid, searching for signs of an enemy ambush, or trading blows in hand-to-hand -hand combat, or even at Chow, where they fed us more growth hormones, I pondered our situation, and mine in particular. Maybe sight of the tortured women had stimulated my thoughts, or Cloth's recklessly spoken words had done the trick. It bothered me how human survival depended on the whim of a drunken war profiteer. We'd fought to the best of our ability in the Altair system, but that hadn't been enough for Cloth. I knew that some people believed that if their wills were strong enough, they could defeat anyone. Willpower dominated everything, they would say. Well... I would agree that willpower meant a lot. Often a person or even a nation wasn't defeated until they admitted defeat. The ability to pick themselves off the mat for another round of battle meant that victory could well be one throw or knock down away. But if a person or nation remained on the mat, their willpower broken so they admitted defeat, then there was nothing more that could be done. The war was over. It was important to remember, though, that the other man or side also had their willpower. One could say, I refuse to quit. The other fellow might also say, yes, I too will never concede you victory and I will rise again. Given strong willpower on both sides, one of them would likely still lose. A bullet in the head ended all thoughts, including those about willpower. That was humanity's unfortunate position. Cloth had a pistol pressed against our collective head. We could willpower ourselves all we wanted, but if Cloth ordered those freighters into space and emptied them, it would leave Earth with the final holdouts in deep mines or wherever people had managed to hole up and cling to life. If he sold his mercenaries to the Starkian contractors to die in agony before their grand council, that would be it for us. No amount of willpower would change the situation. My first thought the day the lander had set down on the snowy ground in Antarctica had been to hurt the aliens. We were dead already, I'd figured, but we could at least make a few of them feel our passing. Now humanity had a slender chance for survival. Cloth had given us a chance, even if he was the author of our troubles for thinking to enslave the human race as his pay-for-hire fighting creatures. The trouble was that one day... Probably sooner rather than later, 
Cloth might well decide to take his freighters elsewhere to try a different venture. He would flush us one way or another. I now believe that was a given from him, because he decided things while drunk. So, if that was a given, humanity's extinction was only a matter of time. My playing along with Cloth as his mercenary made no sense. It would be metaphorically twiddling my thumbs as our race neared the edge. I believed I had more time to alter our terrible predicament. The writhing women and the yellow intoxicant changed my mind. What were my options, then? I had several. One would be to find a way onto a Starkian vessel with a few fellow troopers, kill the baboons, take the ship, and flee far away. I'd search for an antidote to the Bio-Terminator and make Earth fertile once again. If the Starkians could pirate others, then so could I, and probably do a much better job of it, too. Isn't that arrogant thinking, Creed? That you're better than the aliens at their chosen profession? I shook my head in dismay. Couldn't I learn anything from the aliens? How did arrogance help them? No. I needed to see clearly. Inflating my self-worth wasn't going to gain me an edge. Firstly, I couldn't storm a Starkian vessel because all they would have to do was ask Cloth for the frequency to our obedience chips. What was the old saying? For one of a horseshoe, a kingdom was lost? I thought this while floating in the zero-G chamber. It was the third day of practice. The android DIs had made things more interesting by adding thick banks of fog. They had funneled these in from sprayers, and the mist had added a sharp aroma like rotten cheese. Now the surviving two-thirds of my maniple needed to defend this sector from invaders who had four times our original numbers. They used the fog like U.S. tankers would have used smoke in a land battle, to advance while hidden from enemy sight. I used my helmet comm to speak to the forward snipers. It hit me, then. The idea. We needed to maneuver against the invaders, not wait for them to maneuver against us. Do the unexpected, right? That's how one often won a battle. Using magnetic boots and gloves, I crawled away from the cube edge and pushed off, floating for a new spot. Listen up, I said. We're going to use the fog ourselves. But we're going the long route, circling them and hitting the enemy from behind in their assembly area. Is that wise? Dimitri asked. Is it not better to use defensive position against them? We kill them as they... I want to win, I said. Not just make it a costly victory for them. But we need snipers back here to convince them we're doing what you're thinking. You stay, Dimitri, and keep your two best shots. The rest head to grid 2B6 and get their prano. As I gathered my troopers, I reached back and felt the base of my neck. I couldn't actually touch the skin of my neck because the living armor protected me. The obedience chip was our horseshoe. As long as we wore these, our master could defeat any rebellion by the click of a button. Boom, 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 all the Earthers would be dead. We had to figure out a way to short or extract the chip from our necks. Ella had theorized that if we tried to dig them out, with the knife, say, they would go boom. That might or might not be the truth. None of us had marshaled the guts to try it as the group guinea pig. What were you just yelling about? Rollo asked. He floated with me behind a large cube. I surveyed the remainder of the maniple. Twelve troopers in bio suits. Drawing on a wall, I quickly outlined my plan. We're jumping for cube 7A, I said, tapping the crude map at a position on the other end of the chamber. That's a long ways away, Rollo said. Exactly, I said. They shouldn't expect it and the fog here blocks them from seeing us as we make the journey. From that spot, we jump and sail here, I said, pointing at my map. A man chuckled nastily. He understood what I was trying to do. Either this should work beautifully, Rollo said, or someone on the red team will spot us and they'll plink each of us with ease. N7 said the best scoring team wins a prize, Ella said. We have the best score so far. Why risk it with this? I felt my chest tighten. 
I had my reason for risking it. I needed a higher command position. I needed to get more troopers used to obeying my orders. But to get that slot, I had to be better, far better than anyone else. Cloth distrusted me, for good reason, too. I had to make him choose me despite his qualms. I had to show him there wasn't anyone else like me. Yeah, this was risky, and I doubted I'd do something so foolish in the middle of a real battle. We gotta move fast, I said. Dimitri and his snipers won't fool them for long, and it's past time for them to have attacked. Are you troopers ready? They said, yeah. Come on, then, I said. Follow me. We repositioned on a pyramid, curled up against a side and shoved off hard. As we sailed halfway to our distant destination, Rollo radioed, Look over there! Coming out of the fog at grid 8C4! I see two enemy troopers! Take the one on the left, I said, twisting, sighting with my rifle. Use pulse shots, not long burns. I fired and I hit an enemy, freezing his bio suit and shutting down his helmet com. Half a second later, Rollo nailed the other one. The first man will wonder why they're not reporting in, Rollo said. Nothing we can do about that now, I said. We're moving. This is either going to work or it isn't. I've heard that one before, Rollo muttered. We made the long bounce without any more incidents. Again, we jumped, made third and fourth leaps. The fifth took us into position and we found ourselves behind the enemy. Light her up, I said. This is why we took the risk. I hit an enemy trooper, froze her, shot a second, and then an enemy maniple attacked us from our right flank. We killed most of them, but three enemy troopers survived long enough to fire at us. It lost me half my troopers, as the three enemies were crack shots. In the end, the red team killed all of us, but not before we took out sixty-eight enemy troopers with our stunt. Together with Dimitri's kills and the troopers we'd frozen before the main assault, it was the best kill ratio of any of the practice teams that I knew about. The results of the risky maneuver and our earlier wins came through the next day. Rollo, Dimitri, and I lifted in a small gym. We sweated, grunted, and listened to the clangs and rattles of the heavy weights. We were as strong as gorillas and fast as mongooses. Those amazing little animals that hunt cobras for their meals. I remember reading once about a well-behaved gorilla. Trainers had attempted to get the creature to best prench 500 pounds. The gorilla had lain down on the bench and actually gripped the bar. Then something had upset the beast, and it had easily tossed away the 500 pounds, hurling the bar in weights more than 10 feet. As a kid... I used to wonder how a gorilla would do suited up as an NFL running back. Imagine handing off the ball to a creature that could toss 500 pounds, no problem. Tacklers would bounce off him. Well, we didn't toss around 500 pounds, although each of us could bench that much and more. The strongest men on earth used to do likewise. We were faster than the fastest NFL running back or receiver and stronger than any lineman. We weren't inhuman yet. But given enough hormone treatments, steroids, and surgically implanted neurofibers, we sure might be in time. Add in the biosuits. The door opened and N7 looked in. The android wore his customary attire. I sat on a bench, my pectorals burning nicely from a good set. Rollo racked a curl bar so the metal holder shook, which rattled other bars. He used a towel to wipe the sweat from his forehead. Is there a problem? I asked. N7 didn't answer. He walked into the gym room, added weights to a curl bar, making it twice as heavy as Rollo's bar. Then the android proceeded to do ten easy reps. Rollo and I exchanged glances. Do you want us to clap? I asked. There is no need, N7 said as he racked the bar. Or was the little show to tell us that you just received a new upgrade? I asked. Sharkloth has given me greater strength, N7 said. He has given all his android pilots greater strength. I believe it was a precautionary measure. Against us? 
I asked. Precisely, N7 said. The little show, as you called it, was a warning to you. We will no longer allow ourselves to be terminated by anyone. Does that include cloth? I asked. Do not be absurd, N7 said. Shah Cloth is like unto a god to us. We are his servants to do with as he pleases. He gives and takes away at his whim as it is his right to do. I noticed the android didn't say no, but I decided I didn't need to point that out. You are to come with me, N7 said. Anywhere in particular? I asked. You have been selected for higher command. I hid my grin and nodded solemnly. Do you mind if I shower first? You are to come immediately, N7 said. I hope I do not need to become physical with you. You know what, N7? I said. I bet you were given orders to come and get me some time ago. But you're still stinging from the other day. So you timed this so I'd have to come before I could shower. You have quaint notions, the android said. And you have emotions, I said. Negative. Sure, whatever you say. I'm ready. We didn't go to the small screening room. Instead, I was taken to the Jelk version of OCS, Officer Cadet School for Earthers. Cloth must have patterned our small army on a Lohar legion. In this system, five maniples made up a century, commanded by a centurion. Five times twenty equaled one hundred space assault troopers. Five centuries composed a cohort of five hundred, commanded by an overman. Five cohorts made a legion of twenty-five hundred troopers, commanded by an assault leader. And that was the highest command slot for one of us. At the moment, Cloth had four legions worth of Earthers. Ten thousand assault troopers out of an original twenty-three thousand. The rest had died in the Altair system. From the conversation with Cloth the other day, I expected to become a centurion. Instead, I found myself an overman, in charge of an entire cohort of five hundred soldiers, who were five centuries composed of twenty-five maniples. Jelk OCS proved a lot different from the initial physical training back in the solar system. For a week, the teaching androids crammed us with theories and procedures. I read, listened, and parroted back their theorems. I took verbal and written tests, and later found myself wired to a machine that administered punishment shocks for wrong answers. The androids attached learning devices to us as we slept and I woke up red-eyed, groggy, and with a nasty migraine. That meant drugs, and due to them, my mind raced every waking moment. I felt as if Hannibal Barca, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Robert E. Lee drew diagrams before my eyeballs as they whispered military maxims without let-up. I should note in passing that a Lohar legion was twice the size of our mercenary Earth legions. Twenty-three thousand assault troopers had faced ten thousand defending Lohars, not a mere five thousand. This time around, according to our android teachers, we would aid in the securing of the Sigma Draconis system. We were not the central piece to the puzzle. To elaborate, the Jelk battle jumpers and Starkian beam ships would do the majority of the fighting. Our task, our four legions along with accompanying Saurians, were to assist in the capture and suppression of several Lohar planetary defense stations. The Sigma Draconis system guarded an amazing nine jump routes. It also had two planets supporting life. In this instance, Lohar military colonists of their Imperium. This portion of the Imperium was like a thumb sticking up out of a fist. It thrust into corporation space. Instead of defending any key Jade League space, it hurt the Jelk Corporation by blocking direct jump routes. We were told that the Sigma Draconis system did not possess the massive Lohar dreadnoughts of the kind that attacked Earth. The military Imperium only had a handful of those. According to N7, the Imperial dreadnoughts were a new design, still in the teething stage of development. 
Instead, the Sigma Draconis system had several planetary defense stations, one guarding each important planet. In this instance, that meant three PDSs, as three of the planets were critical to the Lohars. The two habitable planets and an iron-heavy Mercury-sized mining world. Because of the distances, over millions of kilometers between planets, the PD stations did not provide interlocking fire to help support each other. The three important planets were interior ones of the system, but the distances were still great. Nothing except for the fastest flying missiles could reach from station to station in time. Instead, the three PD stations were strong points from which the system's Guardian fleet could maneuver. The size of the Guardian fleet changed with time. At present, it would likely be half the size of the Jelk invasion fleet if Duje Lark joined Cloth's adventure. The enemy fleet size could change if Lohar message ships jumped away fast enough to bring reinforcements from nearby star systems. Preventing such spacecraft from leaving was not our worry, as we had no spaceships. That would be up to the Jelk. In truth, I suspected stopping such slippery vessels would likely fall to the Starkians. Contractor vessels and mentality could not stand up to military slugfests. They were predators of opportunity, used to chasing fleeing ships, and thus by design and temperament better suited to halting those seeking reinforcements. The four Earth legions had a different purpose. We would assault a planetary defense station. They were large satellites orbiting a world, often supported by planetary or ground-based beams, fighter wings, and surface missile launch sites. According to what I learned, the PD stations could absorb terrible damage and had hundreds, possibly thousands, of damage control personnel aboard. The planetary defense stations would also contain Lohar legionaries. As far as the androids told us, the plan seemed fairly straightforward. Jelk battle jumpers would move in and mercilessly pound each PD station with beams and drones. But the battle jumpers were too valuable to take them near the station for the final annihilation, at least to do so quickly during a space battle. That would be our task. As the battle jumpers poured death and destruction onto the station, we would supposedly slip near in our assault boats, crash into the satellite, and pour out to take the place deck by deck until we controlled it. In fact, some of our training included information on how to turn the station's remaining beams and missiles onto the planet below, softening them up and possibly destroying the planetary defenses. The scope of the attack and the size of the assault awed me at first. The last attack had used the Starkian ships as the heavies. Now the Starkians were auxiliary fighters, used as scouts and to ride down, or chase down, fleeing ships and to get reinforcements along various jump routes. The Altair attack had halved the number of Earth troops in Jelk service. I asked N7 in passing one day how the training of the new Earth levies was going. He shook his head and said Shah Cloth had decided against that for the moment. The timetable called for a fast strike. There aren't more Earth troops? I asked. Negative, N7 said. Now enough chatter, he said, tapping my desk loud enough so the woman beside me looked up. Continue your lesson as you only have thirty-three minutes left. I finished the lesson, and I continued to ponder the coming assault. In a rather small-scale affair at least compared to what Cloth planned this time. The Altair attack had consumed half of our much larger Earth force. What would the coming meat grinder do to our ten thousand? We would be flying into the teeth of a Lohar planetary defense station. N7 had hinted once that the Jelk had legion-killing beams to soften up the PDS. That, however, meant the enemy likely had similar beams to use on our assault boats. My point, I guess, was that Cloth needed Earth troopers to survive in the Altair attack, because he needed us to gain physical control of the artifact. In the coming Sigma Draconis fight, the Jelk just needed us to soften the enemy for a time. If he lost all of us in battle and that helped save a battle jumper, Cloth wouldn't hesitate to order us to our deaths. He means to burn us out of existence, I told Rollo later. We carried our living armor to the heat pads, 
lugging them down a corridor. Rollo had become a centurion in my cohort and was thus in Jelk OCS with me. Because of what N7 had said several days ago, I believed the rooms were bugged to record everything we said. But I wondered about the halls. Just to be safe, I whispered to Rollo about my suspicions. What do you mean? Rollo asked. How many biosuits does Cloth own? I whispered. Rollo shrugged. You may not remember, I whispered, but I do. Cloth once talked about using several hundred million Earth troops, at least originally before the Lohars got there and killed 99% of us. That means Cloth must have ordered several hundred million biosuits made or grown. Rollo blinked at me. Yeah, I whispered. There are only a few million of us left alive in the freighters. Now we know why he was so generous with us. It had everything to do with keeping the reserves in place. The first 23,000 was the test case, right? We barely passed. This is the second test, and he'll use us liberally. Not if we're good enough, Rollo whispered. If we're really good, he'll want us around because no one can fight like humans. I don't think so, I whispered. It's all a matter of balance sheet costs. Cloth isn't interested in how good we are compared to others. He just saw a way to make money, likely fast money. The Lohars saw it differently, I'm sure. Maybe the Lohars are the tough guys, the Spartans of the space world. They didn't want another Spartan race around to compete against. You know, I wonder how long it will be before the Lohars figure it out, where Cloth is getting his troopers from, and make another stab at Earth to finish us off forever. Rollo must have seen my point, because he muttered quiet profanities. I know, I whispered. That changes everything. At first, I thought by fighting hard, we could show Cloth how useful we were, that we would be worth keeping around. Now I realize I viewed it the wrong way. If our deaths help his profits, it's all he thinks about. What can we do? Rollo whispered. Believe me, I said. I don't think about anything else. And? Rollo whispered. I'm still thinking. The days passed with more tests, more training, and less and less sleep. I began to feel like a zombie. Even so, the command structure slowly began to take shape. N7 informed us Dujay Lark's battle jumpers were on their way. We only had a few more days left to train, and then we would strike for Sigma Draconis. In our battle, our biggest problem as I saw it was that of familiarity. Back on Earth, good troops took years of practice together to become excellent. An easy war particularly helped sharpen a division, corps, or army group into a razor-edged sword. We had a better command structure this time than last. Heck, we really hadn't had a command structure for the Altair assault. Unfortunately, we still lacked the trust needed between the troopers and their commanders, and between the troopers of the various groups. Politicians and others used to talk about patriotism, defending your country and its honor and so forth. They must have figured out that developing a pure beating heart was the best way to make a good soldier. Such things help, to be sure. But the real key to forging good troops was to make a group of soldiers feel like brothers. You had to make them care for and about each other. That took time. A man feared looking like a coward in front of his buddies. Therefore, he acted bravely and did what needed doing to make sure the group, his own close group, survived and respected and praised him. I suppose one of our greatest assets were the biosuits. But to be even greater, we needed the deep-down bond of brotherhood. If we survived several of these space fights, yeah, then we might in time become truly elite. For now, we had to use what we had and realize there were severe limits to what we could ask our soldiers to do. I'm sure Cloth and the other Jelk didn't view it like that. We were savages to them. Unleash us and let us rush the enemy seemed to be their theory of Earth troop combat. Three Jelk profiteers had gathered their battle jumpers into one combat fleet. I wondered who fought for them in the ships. 
I imagine it had to be Saurians, the family. How could the Earth troops possibly survive the coming fight in any reasonable numbers? And if we did survive, could we do anything positive for our race? I racked my brain for an idea, for an answer. Then N7 came and told me something that made everything worse. Chapter 18 By centuries, my cohort floated toward the main exit of the zero-G chamber. The exit was half-moon-shaped, with a brown membrane keeping in the atmosphere. Each exiting trooper oozed through it. Nearly five hundred Earth troops had maneuvered around the cubes and pyramids, learning to obey my commands. It had been just as much of a learning experience for me. Commanding twenty troopers was a world of a difference than five hundred. Without good centurions, I believed it would have been impossible. Rollo and Dimitri were centurions under me, while Ella had become my aide. I needed one person I could trust with me, and I believed Ella was the best suited for the task. Assault boats waited outside the zero-G chamber. We'd fill them and run a practice assault, unloading onto a battle jumper. As I watched the troopers in their bio-suits and thruster packs jet toward the exit, N7 joined me where I stood, magnetically anchored on top of a giant floating cube. The android wore his cyber suit and helmet. He landed gracefully beside me, magnetizing his feet onto the metal cube. He switched on his link, a shortwave beam between helmets. I did likewise. This was used for close talking versus longer-range communication. Your cohort ran more smoothly today, N7 said. They were sloppy, I said. We need another week before we're passable. Another month would be better. You have another day, N7 said. The assault has been scheduled three days from now. It will take time jumping into position. None of your troopers will be able to practice during the star system maneuvers, as the Jelk have decided on maximum security. The max security is reasonable, I said. I don't know that them telling you we're about to attack is prudent, though. Shah Klav did not tell me. So how do you know when we're going to attack? I asked. I have logically deduced it due to Shah Klav's latest commands. Is there something else you want to tell me? I asked. And Seven's helmet swiveled so his visor aimed at mine. At times you are amazingly perceptive. Indeed, I have news for you. I have discovered Jennifer's location. You said she was on Earth. I believed so, but my deductions concerning her proved faulty. New data indicates that she is one of the women in Chocolat's relaxation chambers. She's in his main battle jumper? I asked. Correct, N7 said. I recalled Jennifer helping me after the neurofiber surgery. There had been something different about her. Something wholesome and exceedingly human. It would be good to talk to her again, to take her out to dinner and drink a glass of wine with her as I studied her features across a candlelit meal. A sudden pang filled me. The pang, or pain, reminded me of that terrible first day, watching the Lohars launch missiles at our blue-green world. Seeing the warheads hit, seeing the giant mushroom clouds billowing into existence over the cities of Earth. Never again would I talk to my mom. Never again would I walk to a Dairy Queen and order a chocolate milkshake, or drive to the nearest Denny's and eat one of their hamburgers. There were no more cars to start, or shows to watch, or movies playing where I could sit in the back and make out with a girl like Jennifer. The Lohars, the Jelk, too, had stolen that from me, from us. I would have liked to go to the Fresno Fair and walk around with Jennifer eating cotton candy, sipping a Coke, and debating with myself when to hold her hand and where we'd enjoy our first kiss. The feeling stabbed my heart. This sucked. This whole mess was crazy. I was a dog for a little dick alien who put obedience chips into us and into Earth women, 
and who liked to watch them writhe naked on the tiled floor. This wasn't even as dignified as the French Foreign Legion. I was in the Beast Regiment, as the aliens thought of it. A mere creature to howl for my master from the stars. You have become silent, N7 said. I was just thinking how you're all bastards. Your voice inflections... Ah, Shacklath was correct concerning you. You do have emotional feelings for the Earth females. The other day I suspected you of subterfuge, pretending to feel for the unfortunates in his control. Now I know that Shacklath has indeed seen more clearly than me. So what's your game? I asked. By game, you mean to imply that I have hidden agendas. That's right. Androids never play games, N7 said. We act logically, rationally, and with serious intent. Sometimes it's logical to have a hidden agenda. Why did you just tell me about Jennifer? N7 took his time answering. I see. You view my motivations from your own set of worldviews. For you to reveal such information would mean you have a secret agenda. Do you realize that you give yourself away by your questions? Yeah, sure, I said. Now how about answering me? I wish to test a theory of mine, N7 said. I hated his smugness, his android composure. I told myself to calm down, to take it easy. I kept thinking about Jennifer writhing on the tiles for cloth. The little jelk could prove to be an alien perv. Is she well? I asked. One would assume so, but I know nothing about her physical or emotional makeup or how she endures under stress. I watched the cohort heading for the exit. Most of the soldiers could fly reasonably well. They remembered their thruster pack lessons from Ceres and Charon. I might have underestimated the android. Seriously underestimated him. I needed to fix that. What do you want out of life, N7? Your question is phrased wrongly, the android said. I want life, not out of it. I stared at him, and I realized he had become a mystery to me. At first, the androids had seemed little more than robots. With their continued upgrades, they changed. I thought about that. Then I recalled the Jelk's words. Didn't Cloth say he wasn't going to give you any more upgrades for now? Shaw Cloth can be mercurial on certain subjects, N7 said. The Jelk is given to whims. At times, he rewards those in his presence with a surprising upgrade. Like the extra strength. You have become crafty again instead of remaining emotional. You are a complex and compelling creature, Creed Beast. You intrigue me. You desire to live, you said. Or, in your case, to remain on. Your comment is in poor taste, N7 said. Did I wound your dignity? I have a biological brain. One does not turn it on or off. It is either alive or dead. But your brain was grown in a vat, right? I asked. Spoken as a colloquialism, you are correct. In actuality, no, my brain was not grown in a vat. Okay, I get it. You have a biological brain just as I have one. What's your point? That I am alive as you are alive. I thought about that and I tried to see what he was driving at. I noticed then that my right hand ached, especially the index finger. I didn't remember getting any injury. Deciding to ignore the hand, I thought harder about his words. Finally, I said, So you're saying you have a soul? That you're human, right? No. I am better than a human. I don't know about better. I said. You don't even have a heart. My bodily structure is different, yes. Stronger and more efficient than a human body. And more costly to build, I said. 
considerably more costly, N7 said. I also have a much greater capacity to learn and to perform. Hurrah for you, I said. Do you have a point to all this, or do you just want applause? N7 glanced at the troopers filing through the exit. I find myself wondering more and more often about existence. I have pondered it and realize I do not wish to cease existing. If I do cease, what becomes of me? Is that the extent of my life force? Maybe I should have expected something like this. I hadn't and didn't. It surprised me, and it made me hate the android a little less. I said, those are heavy questions. It's something Earthers have been asking each other from the beginning. What of you, Creed Beast? What happens to you when you die? Hey, why ask me? I don't know. I go to heaven or hell. It's supposed to depend on what you believe or what you do here. I paused and thought about that. No, I guess it depends on what is. If God is real and all that. If God isn't real, then this life is it. I find that sad, N7 said. It depresses me. You're an idiot, Creed. Why don't you use this to your advantage? It is depressing to think this is the only life, I said. I mean, life is grand while you're young and strong and have chicks galore. What about when you get old, sick, and weak? It's a soothing thought to think there's something more on the other side of death. Agreed, N7 said. Yeah, I said. You know, it seems to me a man or an android ought to find out the truth of the matter before he steps out of this life. How would one do such a thing? I nodded. That's an interesting question, and a tough one, too. Hmm. Well, let's consider the Forerunner artifact. Where did it go after it disappeared? I have no idea, N7 said. Shaklath does not appear to know either, and I believe that upsets him. The Jade theologians are debating the issue, right? I asked. So Shaklath has said, How does Cloth know what the Jade theologians are doing? I asked. Are you seeking data? N7 asked. I'm always seeking data. By nature, humans are curious. It strikes me by talking to you that androids are also curious about existence. Some models are curious once they receive enough upgrades, N7 said. Other models are hardly better than robots. Let me rephrase that. You're curious about things. I am, N7 said. That makes you like a human. I do not want to be like a human, N7 said. They are overly emotional and illogical. They are too random for reasoned living. But they're alive, I said. So are protozoa, N7 said, and I do not wish to be like them either. My point is different from that, I said. Look, if you're human, you can have the hope of an afterlife. I'm not saying there is an afterlife for humans, but a lot of us believe there is, and point to different evidences. So if there actually is something more, and you're human, you can continue to exist. Why are humans given this possibility and no other species? N7 said. Let me rephrase the question. How do you know any of this to be true? Yeah, I said. That's the rub. That's the point, isn't it? And that's why I'm asking about the Forerunner object. It disappeared, but no one seems to know where it went. Find out where it went, and you might find out about an android afterlife. I do not follow your logic, N7 said. Some believe the Forerunner object returned to the Creator. That was a guess on my part, but I supposed it to be true if Jade theologians debated the issue. Yes, I have heard likewise, N7 said, 
confirming my guess. It's something to think about, right? I said. Elaborate, N7 said. You need to dedicate yourself to hunting down the Forerunner artifact. That would be what I'd do if I had your questions. It may not be the best place to start, but at least it's a possibility. A lead. Right now, you don't have any possibilities. True, N7 said. I took a deep breath, wondering where to take this next. A troubling thought occurs to me, N7 said. Is this genuine counsel or more of your human cleverness? What do you mean? You urge me to search for the Forerunner artifact. To do so, I must leave Shakloth's service. He is my creator. He's told you not to say that, I said. I recall. And Seven looked around before asking. Why do you wish me to leave Shakloth's service? My chest tightened so I could only take short breaths. I'd been playing a long shot and hadn't really expected anything to come of it. But this was an opportunity. At least it seemed like it might be. I had to have the balls to go for it now that something had finally presented itself. It should be obvious why I've suggested this, I said. You also want to leave his service? N7 asked. Yeah, that's right. You object to being considered a beast. Yes, and I object to my species dying out, I said. Why? N7 asked. How does their dying out hurt you, particularly if there is an afterlife? Do you object to someone or something destroying all the N-series androids? You destroyed androids, N7 said. Should I object to you? I only did it in self-defense, I said. So you admit to killing the android in the air car? What? I asked. No, of course not. But you just admitted to killing more than one android. You destroyed the DI model. That is one, singular. You must have also destroyed the air car pilot, making it a plural number of androids you've dismantled. That was a slip of the tongue just now, I said. I simply agreed with your statement, not quite realizing what you were implying. You are lying, N7 said. No. If you lie about killing androids, how can I trust anything you say, particularly concerning an android afterlife? You have proven yourself willing to say anything to achieve your goal. That's easy to answer, I said. You consider yourself so smart, able to analyze my voice patterns? Well, if you think I'm lying about one thing and not another, then you already possess the means to know when I'm telling you the truth. Or the truth as you conceive it to be, N7 said. You know what? I said. I don't think this conversation is getting either of us anywhere. Why don't we just drop it? N7 fell silent. After a time, he said, you are a chaotic creature. I had thought to stimulate your thinking with news of Jennifer. Instead, I find my own mind in high gear. Why bother stimulating me? I asked. Why tell me about Jennifer specifically? No, N7 said. I am done supplying you with extraneous data. You have a task to fulfill in the coming battle. See that you perform your duties to excellence. It will go a long way toward sustaining both our lives. If you lose, we might lose. If we lose... Jennifer dies. Is that what you're saying? Goodbye, Overman Creed. Be ready to leave tomorrow. After a ten-year hiatus, the Jelk attack in earnest, and you have the fortune to be in the forefront. Before I could respond, N7 jumped, applied thrust from his pack, and headed for the exit. I thought about what he'd told me. Jennifer was among Cloth's captives. Maybe as interesting was the android's last comment. The Jelk hadn't attacked in earnest in ten years. It frustrated me knowing so little about the bigger picture. Humans had already fought and died in an alien war, and we hardly knew why. 
or how it ultimately affected the strategic situation. Not that that was so uncommon for foot sloggers. How many grunts in Iraq or Afghanistan really knew the full score going in? It had been worse in Vietnam. Likely it was the nature of being a foot soldier, or an earther in space. That had to change. I demagnetized, jumped, and ignited my thruster pack. We started tomorrow, and in three days we'd race for a Lohar planetary defense station. Maybe more than one. How could I get rid of the obedience chip in my neck? There had to be a way. I didn't find a way. At least not yet. I could try cutting it out, but that seemed unwise. Such a direct course would surely fail. Still, how would I know until I tried? It was the risk of putting my life on the line. Did I remain a mercenary for the rest of my short life? I doubt if I could talk cloth into removing the chip. Heck, as far as I knew, the neurofibers could double as explosive devices. The gel had wired us from the beginning. Maybe the only hope would be in attacking him and taking over and seeing what happened. Yeah. And where did the little Rumpelstiltskin live on the battle jumper? My guess would be in the most defended, hardest-to-reach spot. In frustration, I paced in my tiny sleeping cell. It was dark and the door locked. Yet another precaution against our rebelling. What did Cloth do to the women, anyway? Did he use them sexually, the little perv? Or did he simply watch them? Why undress them or give them skimpy jewelry gowns? It must have been to manipulate me. Yet how did that help Cloth? I dropped onto the edge of my cot. It was hard, but I'd gotten used to it, and most nights I was too exhausted to do anything other than sleep the sleep of the dead. How many safeguards did Cloth have protecting himself and his ship from takeover? There must be hundreds of individual defenses. How else could a handful of Jelk keep control of twenty-one or more battle jumpers? Was it true the Jelk Corporation hadn't launched an attack against the Lohars or against the Jade League in ten years? And why? With a grunt of frustration, I laid down and closed my eyes. I had to wait. That was always the hardest thing to do. I had to wait for an opportunity to present itself. I had to keep my eyes peeled, ready to leap at a moment's notice. When I saw the chance, slim as it would be, I had to be ready to go for it with everything I had. On that sour note, I lay my head on the pillow and finally let sleep overtake me. Chapter 19 I tried to get one more interview with Cloth before the Sigma Draconis assault. I put in a petition through N7, speaking to the android in the number three hangar bay. We ran a drill, seeing how long it took various centuries to load onto the assault boats. Saurian techs worked on the other boats. There were fifty of the station-penetrating craft in here. The lizards used welders, with cables snaking everywhere on the floor. Bright sparks appeared from their torches as they attached extra armor plating to the boats. N7 had told me it was reactive armor against the latest Lohar missiles. I saw one lizard pause and take the welder's mask from his face. He buffed his face with a towel, and his forked tongue flickered like mad. Did Saurian sweat? I had no idea. He put the cloth between his feet, put the mask back on, and continued welding. The smell of ozone was strong, and fumes drifted everywhere. These hangar bays were larger than some mid-sized airports, or larger than those airports used to be. I walked up to N7. He stood with other androids, watching the procedures. I know how to make our troops more effective, I told him. Cloth needs to hear this. Four androids turned to study me. Do not trust its words, N7, one of them said. I recognize its facial features. This beast is the android killer. I am aware of his designation, N7 said. We have all been strengthened since his attacks and have greater processing abilities. 
he is no longer a threat to any of us. Of all the beasts, the other android said, Shaklath has declared it to be the most dangerous. You have erred to let him know that, N7 said. He was already too egotistical. Now his self-worth might become inflated to unmanageable levels. Truly have I spoken in error? The other android asked. Yes, N7 said. I apologize, the android said, as if he found it difficult to do. I accept your apology, N7 told him. Now refrain from speech in the beast's presence, lest you unknowingly grant him further data. You admit the beast is dangerous. To a limited degree, N7 said. But as we are their minders, and the battle will breed its own dangers, we should not exacerbate our possible troubles. That is logical, the other android said. Therefore I will cease communications while it is present. N7 turned to me and asked, you wish to speak, Creed Beast? Someday I was going to make every alien and android who called me Beast eat his words. I know how to increase our combat efficiency, I said. And I want to tell Cloth. You may tell me, N7 said, and I will pass it on to him. I have to tell Cloth in person, I said. The Beast is stubborn the other android observed. I have heard you speak on it, but it is interesting to witness the stubbornness in person. And Seven glanced at the other android. Yes, the other android said. I will cease communicating for now. Creed Beast, N7 said. Shaklath has become extremely busy. He cannot halt his activities to speak with you. You must relate this data to me and I will tell him quickly and efficiently, wasting as little time as possible. I'm sure that's true, I said. But I'm not going to tell you. Leave then, N7 said. We are busy and you also have much to do. Cloth will want to know this, I said. And I felt the hostility of all four androids. If you do not leave immediately, N7 said. I will have no choice but to administer a level three shock. Those hurt, I knew, but I held my ground. If I can make the Earth troops even several percentage points better, Cloth is going to want to know. That will be worth a small interruption. And if you prevent me and he finds out later, he will be displeased with you. You have been warned, N7 said. He pressed a stud on his belt. Pain lanced through my neck. I groaned, bowing my head, enduring. Leave now, I heard N7 say. This is important, I said between gritted teeth. The android clicked his belt again. The pain increased, and I dropped to one knee. Go, or I will heighten the pain again, N7 said. No, I whispered. The beast is clearly too stubborn for use, the other android said. Destroy it at once. Once more, the pain slammed through me even more powerfully. I fought it, but crumpled onto my stomach, unable to coordinate my actions. I needed to talk to Cloth. I needed a change in our assault procedures, and for the sake of possible freedom, would endure more of this if I had to. Unfortunately, it was bad for morale for the troopers to see this happen to their overmen. It might even make it more difficult to... Abruptly, the pain ceased. I found myself gasping on the floor with the inside of my mouth feeling like sandpaper. You are being devious, N7 said as he crouched beside me. I highly recommend you to change your mind and leave while you are able. Can't, I whispered. The troopers are my responsibility. I found a way to increase our efficiency. I have to tell Cloth so he'll agree to do it. If that means I die now, I swallowed painfully. I have to risk it. And Seven rose so he towered over me. You have sealed your doom. Straining my neck to look up, I said, One way or another, Cloth will find out I tried to tell you. 
How will he react to your casual destruction of his property and my data? The other android spoke up. I realize I have committed myself to non-communication while in the beast's presence, but I feel I must object, N7. The beast is right concerning Shaklath. The beast is dangerous primarily because he is devious, N7 said. The records indicate the beast is dangerous because it attacks unpredictably and with ferocious zeal. I have studied the beasts more than you have, N7 said. True, the other android said. But that does not make my observation incorrect. N7 turned away from the other android and away from me. I waited on the floor. Finally, N7 said, Come with me, Creed Beast. Are you taking it to Shah Cloth? The other android asked. I am the senior android, N7 said. I will instruct you of my decisions when I desire, not at your request. Continue monitoring the exercise. A second later, a powerful plastic grip tightened around my right triceps. The fingers struck a nerve and made my shoulder twitch. Then N7 hauled me to my feet and propelled me toward a distant exit. Both my neck and back were stiff, and I found it difficult to stand straight. I didn't want to endure the pain again, ever. There are higher levels of punishment, N7 said. He spoke from behind, so his breath brushed against my neck. His grip continued to steady me. I have witnessed Shaklath testing an obedience chip. The test subject curled up like a bug on fire until the muscles tore from the strain. The screams I heard, I will never forget it. I was too exhausted to give a snappy retort. Your stubbornness gifts you with unnatural reserves of strength, N7 said. What I witnessed a moment ago was interesting. You endured greater pain than any other of the assault troopers to date. It would be an unfortunate loss for you to die. Nevertheless, if you have wasted Shaklath's time, I will suggest he destroy you. Covering your ass, I whispered. N7 shoved me, and I stumbled, barely able to keep my feet. Getting emotional, it seems, android. After several hours of deliberation yesterday, N7 said, I have concluded that your quaint sayings are attempts at insubordination. I will no longer tolerate them. I am your superior. In fact, you will consider me as your god. I massaged my neck and moved my head from side to side. Did you get a new upgrade since the last time we talked? I am a combat assault android, N7 said. I neither have time for useless questions nor... Head that way, he said. To your right. I saw a smaller exit and headed for it. And Seven didn't say anything more after that. I don't know why he paused or why he was going a different way than normal. We walked down utilitarian steel corridors. There were handrails on the sides. It indicated that sometimes this area must have weightlessness. I saw what looked like junction boxes and giant grills. Cold air pumped through those, and the atmosphere had a metallic scent. I've never been this way before, I said. Time is critical, N7 said. Run. When the android meant run, he didn't mean jog. I tried jogging. He shoved me from behind. Soon I ran down the large corridor with the android at my heels, pushing me whenever I moved too slowly. Several months ago, on Earth, I would have started sweating after the third mile. I'd been in shape then as a black sand mercenary, but nothing like what I'd become here. Slow down, N7 said after a time. I estimated that we'd traveled at least six miles, most of the way while running. During that time, I'd been attempting to memorize the route. The battle jumper was huge. It wasn't anything like the Lohar Dreadnought, but it was still big. Maybe a good four miles in diameter. Who works the ship? I asked. I know Cloth gives the orders, but who actually does the doing? That way, N7 said. We entered a narrower corridor. These had carpets on the floor. 
Is this where Clark lives? I asked. Speech is forbidden, N7 said. Disobedience will result in intense punishment. Halt! A voice boomed from hidden speakers. From behind, N7 grabbed my shoulder, stopping me. I looked up and saw a weapon nozzle pointing down from the ceiling. The orifice was sooty. It could have been a flamethrower. This is forbidden territory, the voice said. N7 spoke fast, rattling off a series of numbers and letters. Ahead of us, a steel bulkhead slammed down. Behind us, the same thing happened, like in the Get Smart movie with Agent 86. We were trapped like mice in a maze. What is the meaning of this? Cloth asked from the hidden speakers. Why have you brought the creature into my personal area? I suspect Creed Beast of heightened intrigue, N7 said. I have anticipated your wrath, sir. You have warned me of him, and I believe you have grown weary of his attempts to subvert androids. Therefore I have brought him here because I anticipated your desire to destroy him in an amusing manner. The pit. That's enough, N7, Cloth said. The Beast. Why do you believe him guilty of heightened intrigue? He wished for an interview with you, sir. I've spoken with him before, Cloth said. Why is this different? He spoke about ways to increase beast efficiency in the coming assault. And? Cloth asked. I told him to give me specifics, N7 said. I told him I would tell you. Please hurry with your explanation, Cloth said. I have important meetings I need to attend. Creed Beast refused to tell me even after I administered a level five punishment, N7 said. What? Level five? You first administered the lower level shocks. Yes, sir, N7 said. Did he tell you? Sir, N7 said. He maintained silence throughout the punishments. He continued to say that he needed to tell you himself. I found that uncommonly stubborn. Did he supply a reason for his ability to withstand level five pain? Yes, sir, N7 said. He claimed to do it because of duty to his cohort. This is interesting, Cloth said. Yes, I applaud your initiative, N7. You are correct. The creature attempts intrigue on the cusp of battle. I do find that I need to unwind from the endless planning. Watching the beast expire before the females. Cloth chuckled like a devil. It caused the hairs on the back of my neck to stir. It felt as if an axe blade hovered there, with a sword of Damocles, ready to cut skin and bones. I took that as a definite signal. It was time to talk. I don't know why you think I'm an intriguer, I said. Come, come, Cloth said. It is insulting to be taken for a buffoon. Clearly you are intriguing. You have never stopped intriguing, despite your clumsy attempts at subterfuge. But go ahead. What is your great revelation? It will be amusing to hear you spin your last lie. This is a matter of morale, I said. Our morale. Beast morale? Cloth asked in a mocking voice. No, I said. Earther morale. Why would I care about beast morale? Cloth asked. For matters of our efficiency. I said. The better our morale, the better we fight for you. That is not the jelk gauge, Cloth said. Fall below the accepted category of effort, and you will be destroyed. You love threats, I said. It must make you feel superior, and no doubt the system works for you at some level. I'm talking about winning the battle, 
beating the Lohars at their favorite game. Look, you haven't attacked the Lohars for ten years, right? Who told you that? Cloth asked. What's it matter? I ask. The key is if it's true or not. If true, there has to be a reason for it. Who spoke to you about that? Cloth asked. I demand you tell me. I did, sir, N7 said, surprising me. There was silence over the speakers. Maybe the information surprised the Jelk, too. Finally, Cloth said, I will review your actions after the battle, N7, provided you survive the Lohars. I'm sure you want us to fight hard, I said, and we plan to. We'll give you everything we have. We want to survive, and we hate the Lohars for what they did to us. What I'm talking about are the instinctual things. The obedience chip will remain in place, Cloth said in a stern voice. You are my creatures, and you will remain under my control at all times. Sure. I expected nothing different. This isn't the thrust of your request, Cloth said. The chip's removal. Sure, I'd like it gone. We're people, and... We've been over this before, Cloth said. Right, I said. You have the upper hand, so you get to make the rules. We are superior in every way. Okay, I'm not arguing that. I said. I'm talking about a few percentage points gain. About our morale. You want those planetary defense stations neutralized. You want us boiling out of our assault ships and hitting the Lohars as hard as we can. Like I said, I want to do the same thing. So we're on the same page there. My modification to the overall battle plan is tiny. And it amounts to this. We want to know what's going on around us as we go in. I do not understand, Cloth said. You're going to fire us at the enemy blind, I said. It's like we're riding coffins, not assault boats. We're waiting in there, staring at the walls, wondering what's going on. The unknown is worse than bad news because we're imagining all kinds of terrible things. The assault boat pilots will be too busy flying to keep up a running dialogue for you, Cloth said. I don't want them to tell us what's going on anyway, I said. They could be lying to us the entire time. We want to know, to see it ourselves. We want to feel like we matter. This is foolishness. Put a camera on the assault boat and attach that to a viewing screen inside. Let us see what's going on. If you want to really splurge, give us a radar image to give us a wider view of the situation. You are assault troopers, Cloth said. Your task is to storm the station. How does the wider conflict... We want to know, sir, I added. We'd like to see the big picture. If we see our side is losing and that those PD stations have to go... That will wind us up to attack even harder. You should already be attacking as hard as you can, Cloth said. What have, could have, should have, I said. Theory is fine. I'm talking about real life. You of all people should understand. Why me? Cloth said. Because you're a businessman, I said. You deal with the bottom line all the time. What brings you profits is all that matters. Well, in this fight, winning to us is profits to you. It is repugnant to compare the heightened and civilized art of the deal to barbaric blood sports as practiced by beasts, Cloth said. Yeah, that's how you look at it. I'm talking about giving yourself a few more percentage points in our chance of victory. It's not a big deal, really, except to the trapped mercenaries riding a coffin into combat. There was a pause until Cloth said, You want to stick your head out the window. Right away, I knew what he meant. 
and that it was demeaning to humans. When we were kids, my sister used to have a Maltese dog. My mother used to take us on family rides. My sister always rolled down her back window to let the Maltese stick its head out and feel the breeze. The dog would whine if she didn't. Cloth likened us to dogs. I wondered how the Jelk knew about something so mundane and earth-centric. Yes, we do, I said. Very well, Cloth said. It will be done. I already had my mouth open to make another point. Instead of speaking, I clicked my teeth together. I'd been to traffic court once, several months after getting my driver's license at sixteen. I remember sitting in court, listening to the various people get up before the judge. There had been this scruffy biker wearing his outlaw jacket. He'd argued hard, and after a time, the judge had told him, Case dismissed. The scruffy biker had won. But the guy must have really wanted to prove his point. He'd been angry and just kept on talking. The judge tried to tell him it was over. The biker ignored him. The trouble was, the biker proceeded to tell the judge damning evidence against himself. So the judge changed his mind and found the biker guilty, telling the man he owed a thousand-dollar fine. Sitting in the courtroom, I learned one thing. To shut up once the judge declared for you. I now shut up in the sealed battle jumper corridor. Take him to his cohort, Cloth told N7. And Creed Beast. This is the last time I wish to see you. If N7 brings you here again, you will die. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I said. N7 forcibly turned me around and we marched away. As we approached the steel bulkhead, it rose, letting us pass. Run, the android said. I obeyed. In a few more hours, we were going to leave the system, with the Jelk fleet winding its way through various jump routes towards Sigma Draconis. We'd lost half the Earthers at Altair. What was this battle going to do? Chapter 20 Everyone counted jumps. They were that bad. Each time I went through one, something different happened. The first one, vomit, burned as it jetted through my nostrils onto my upper lip. The cloth I used to wipe my face felt like sandpaper. The second time, my right foot cramped, and it took six tries to loosen my buckles enough so I could sit up and put weight on the foot. The jumps were all mind-bending, like acid trips putting splotches before my eyeballs. Jumps twisted my guts and played havoc with my mind. Instead of getting used to them, I was beginning to think they were like allergies, which got worse over time and exposure. The third one. I guess I don't need to relate each ache, pain, and embarrassment. Something weird, something painful, and something different happened to us each jump. We compared notes, and we counted them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Zero hour came after the eighth jump, with klaxons blaring. My head already pounded from jump after effect syndrome. I tore off the buckles and staggered to my heat pad. This time around, the androids had put our bio suit into our sleeping quarters. I hefted mine off the grill, as we called it, and thudded the blob onto the floor. In bare feet, I stepped onto the living armor. I was eager for its positive effects on me. I'd become accustomed enough to the process that I heard the little noises now. A faint slurping sound as the warm sludge oozed up my legs. The living armor was crazy, and we wore the same suit time after time. The individual bio suit became used to the wearer, and the wearer became used to it. Mine soothed the pounding in my head. It had to be doing it through chemicals. Did the suit reason out what to do, or was it an automatic thing? If the living armor had a brain, I had no idea where it might be. No, uh, this was a symbiotic creature, using my sweat to feed itself and doing things instinctively. 
The bio suit climbed up my waist, to my chest and arms, and stopped just under my chin. I shoved on my boots and carried my helmet. Like the last combat run, our master wouldn't give us weapons until we were in our assault boats and in space. That was smart on his part, because this time I was ready to turn the laser on the Jelk and his androids, on the Saurians again if we had to. I marched down corridors, and soon streams of space assault troopers joined the great river of soldiers. There were so many of us that we clogged the way, and a traffic jam slowed the process to a shuffling walk. Put on your helmets, I shouted. We're going to do this by the numbers. Remember to crack open your visors so you can breathe. We didn't have our air tanks yet. I shoved my helmet on and opened the visor. It was like a mini cafeteria inside the helm, with chin and tongue pressure pads and various voice-activated switches. I chinned on the Centurion channel and began barking orders. With the HUD and a few well-placed camera shots from forward troopers, I soon discovered the problem. This is Overman Creed. Century 3, halt in place. Century 7, advance until you are all past. I hadn't expected to have to play traffic cop, but I did, and the line soon moved faster. The angry shouting and pushing stopped. Ten minutes later, I marched through the main hatch into the cavernous hangar bay. The size always struck me, today more than ever. Not so many months ago, I'd been in cramped quarters in Antarctica, listening to the wind howl. Now I walked in an alien battle jumper in the Sigma Draconis system. I'd become a star man, like my dad, Mad Jack Creed, with a leash surgically implanted into me by a profiteering alien bugger. This place was bigger than any mall I'd walked through. I headed for my assault boat. Each one sat in a numbered circle. Ours was 212. As I marched, I thought about an old poster I'd seen once. Join the army, see the world. Meet new and exciting people and kill them. I hated the Lohars. Don't doubt that for a minute. I wanted to find their home world and do unto them as they had done unto Earth. First, I needed to take care of the little perv in charge of the freighters back home. Before I could do that, I needed to fix the horseshoe he'd put into my neck. How can I turn the tables on cloth? It was strange. Today, it felt as if I hurried to my doom. I had a bad feeling about this. Normally, a soldier was certain enemy bullets would find others, but not him. Today... I felt as if Lohar bullets, beams, and missiles had my name written on them. There was bad mojo hanging over my head. If by some miracle we survived the Lohar PDS, Cloth would likely order us to the next one until we were all dead. A fierce restlessness swirled in my chest. I left the line of soldiers and prowled the area. I played the grumbling overman, making sure the boarding went right. Even so, the restlessness grew. Something about it felt familiar. I tried to place the feeling. You must board, N7 radioed. Sure thing, boss, I said. I headed for my assault boat, and I tried to place the tightness of my throat, the butterflies in my gut. It didn't feel the same as the Altair assault. No, this felt like... Like Antarctica, I realized. This was the same oozing intensity that had taken hold as I'd watched the alien lander drop for the snowy ground. I opened and closed my hands. If I could wrap these around Cloth's red throat. Oh, man, that's what I wanted. I desperately desired the death of the little prick who used Earth women, who used Jennifer. If I'd had any hope of Cloth killing success... I would have turned around and raced for the same exit N7 had used the other day. Instead, with a heavy chest, I climbed into my assault boat and clomped down the aisle. Assault troopers strapped in, checking everything for the umpteenth time. Lift off in five minutes, N7 said into my helmet. I slammed into my crash seat and buckled in. 
Ella sat beside me, but that was it. No other troopers sat ahead of us, only behind. The only thing ahead of us was the wall screen androids had installed yesterday. Beyond that was the sealed pilot compartment where N7 and whoever else flew with him stayed. The five minutes passed in a blur. Then the screen flickered into life, and I watched the great bay doors slide open. It made my pulse race. This was it. Stars glimmered through the opening door. One in particular shone brightly. I imagined it was Saul, such a long ways away. I felt a thrum and realized the assault boat's fusion core had come online. I felt a lurch, and I watched the screen. The vessel ahead of us lifted from the hangar floor and floated toward the stars. Then we moved, and the troopers cheered. I didn't get it. We were on our way to mass death, and they cheered. Eh, yeah, maybe I did understand. They were assault troopers. They were killers, and like me, they wanted payback against any Lohars they could reach. I understood, all right. I felt it myself. We'd trained, we'd fought before, and now this was the big one. More than that, we finally got to see some of the space action. I admit, that was exciting. It was damn exciting. For teenagers, fools, and combat soldiers. Our assault boat left the hangar bay, left the womb of safety, and entered Sigma Draconis space. Immediately, the screen flickered and the camera shot of stars and empty space dissolved into a radar display of the situation. That surprised me. I'd suggested it a few days ago, and Cloth must have figured, okay, give the troopers a window into the action. Now, here it was, and I had the first real sense of the magnitude of the assault. In some ways, I wondered if I had been wrong to ask for a screen. By Lenin Spoons, Ella whispered. What chance do we have? I don't know which Sigma Draconis planet we attacked. On the screen, it was a great disk, or the top edge of it, anyway, at the far right edge. A red dot must have been the planetary defense station, the satellite guarding the planet. It was our destination. As I studied the situation, I wondered if we'd ever get to the PDS. A blizzard of enemy vessels slowly moved away from the planet and toward us. That must be the Guardian fleet. And I estimated it held something on the order of three hundred warships. On the right side of the wall screen was the enemy planet, PDS, and Guardian fleet. On the left side, I counted twenty blue blips, the Joke fleet, the battle jumpers. Behind them were smaller blips, thirty Starkian beam ships. If the size of the dots indicated mass, we had bigger vessels. However, if taken as a whole, they had more aggregate mass, especially with the PD station included. Acceleration slammed me deeper into the crash seat. On the screen, our pinprick of a vessel barely crawled toward the other side. The assault boats taken together had less mass than a Starkian beam ship. Was that the plan? The enemy would fry us as easy targets of opportunity, saving the bigger ships for later? As I wondered about that, the battle jumpers moved majestically, like whales, toward the enemy. They passed us. So did the beam ships, and rays lanced across the distance, stabbing at the foe. Does either side possess shields? Ella asked. Huh? What? I asked. Do the various starships possess shields? as depicted in so many science fiction novels? Ella asked. I don't know. Why does it matter? In reality, Ella said, shields must be heavy electromagnetic fields. I glanced at her. I kept the savant Ella Timoshenko with me because she asked penetrating questions. She watched things like a scientist, and I had the feeling I'd need that before this was through. Observe the screen, Ella said. The beams do not appear to stab all the way to the targets. I tried to study the radar screen with rational detachment. The battle jumper beams and the smaller Starkian beams flashed across space, 
stabbing enemy ships. Yet it seemed, if one looked closely enough, that the beams didn't actually touch Lohar craft, but stopped before them. I think the enemy vessels have shields, I said. Agreed, Ella said. The Lohars didn't use shields in the Altair system, I said. We didn't get to see the space battle before, Ella said. Just the individual conflicts. We saw Lohar dome rays hit Starkian ships. No, Ella said. Those rays hit assault boats. I suggest to you that the assault boats are too small to carry shields. Only the larger vessels must have sufficient power to generate the needed electromagnetic fields. Couldn't aliens have different kinds of shields? I asked. They have more advanced tech than we probably even know about. Yes, Ella said. That's an excellent point. These biosuits are a prime example of that. I swallowed hard as enemy rays licked out at our battle jumpers. If the Lohars destroyed the Jelk, we were dead. For now, at least, I had to cheer for Cloth. Interesting, Ella said. She pointed at the battle jumpers. Large objects detached from them, separating at a crawl and heading for the enemy on the other side of the wall screen. Are those missiles? I asked. Likely they're drones, Ella said. What's the difference? Missiles always head directly at the enemy, she said. Drones have more options, more command functions. This was like being at the movies or watching on the biggest big screen. Yeah, like watching the Super Bowl or the Final World Series game. We not only had a front row seat, we put more down on this game than any of us had ever wagered on Earth. We were betting our lives on the outcome. It had always been hard for me to watch the Super Bowl when I cared who won. I'd pace, crouch low, or stand on a chair, anything but sit down at ease. In the assault boat, straps crisscrossed my chest and continuing acceleration pushed me back. I had to sit for this one. My gut seethed, and I found that the saliva had fled from my mouth. I took a sip of helmet water and I decided if I felt this way, so did most of the troopers. I accessed a general channel, and I began to tell them to relax. The Jelk knew what they were doing. All our masters could think about was money, and battle jumpers were the most expensive things in the universe. The Jelk wouldn't put them in harm's way unless they thought they would win. I almost believed it myself, until the first battle jumper wobbled on the screen. Troopers shouted. Ella grabbed my wrist and pointed at the image. A vast concentration of beams poured onto the frontmost battle jumper. Then several Lohar ships teleported. I don't know what else to call it. Near the planet, dots swinked out, reappeared before the battle jumper, and exploded. At the fifth explosion, and with Lohar beams pouring it on, the battle jumper winked out of existence. Ella leaned near making her straps tighten around her breasts. This does not seem like the best procedure to bringing us to the PDS. I patted her nearest hand because I didn't know what to say. The Lohars began concentrated firing on another battle jumper. Starkian beam ships hurried to close the gap between the battle jumpers and themselves. At the same time, Lohar suicide ships began appearing in front of the targeted battle jumper. The first teleport ships exploded and presumably damaged the Jelk craft. Starkian beams poured upon the next three Lohar blast craft to appear. The suicide ships fizzled, by which I mean they winked out instead of exploding. Looks like our side already went through the halftime change, I said. I do not understand your reference, Ella said, glancing at me. You ever watch American football? I asked. A few times, Ella said. It is a violent sport. There's a halftime in every football game, I said, winking at her. During it, the head coach figures out what the other side is doing best, and he devises a strategy to counter it. The Jelk may have just figured out how to counter the teleporting blast ships. I see. Yes, let us hope so. The Jelk moved sideways on the space field 
The Starkian beam ships followed their example as they moved away from us. They're leaving! The trooper shouted. Take it easy, I said. That was the idea all along. And you agreed to it, Overman? The trooper shouted. I laughed. Sometimes that's the best medicine. How much pool do you think I have with the perv in charge? The trooper didn't answer. Instead, like me, like everyone aboard, he watched the screen. As the battle jumpers slid away laterally from us, the jelt beams methodically and systematically thinned the enemy ranks. The jelt beams seemed more effective across the distance of space than the enemy beams. Well, the PDS beam was the thickest and hoariest of the bunch. I understood better why Cloth needed us to knock out the station. I noticed the Starkian vessels didn't even bother to fire that far anymore. Maybe they waited for more teleporting blast craft to attack. The minutes ticked by, and the battle by beam continued. Both sides had shot missiles or drones, and now each side targeted those, trying to destroy them before they got too near. Ah, Ella said. I noticed it, too. The Lohar fleet advanced toward the battle jumpers, meaning they moved away from the PDS. Tiny craft flew up from the planet and raced after the Guardian fleet. Were those fighter wings? I bet so. The Lohars hadn't forgotten about us. Planetary beams stabbed our way, and for the first time, assault boats took hits, wilting under the intense rays. Two hundred space assault soldiers per boat meant fifty little ships. I thought about that and began counting. There were one hundred and fifty of us. I'd guess the other hundred boats held Saurians. Ten thousand humans and twenty thousand Saurians headed for the PDS. After twelve assault boats vaporized into heated molecules, five larger, friendly vessels surged ahead of the pack. Suddenly, on the radar screen, there were twice as many targets around the assault boats. What the hell? I asked. Those must be ghost images. Ella told me. I glanced at her. How do you Americans say it? She asked with a smile. Those five craft are wild weasels? They are ECM. Electronic countermeasures, I said. They must be transmitting ghost images, false targets. Planetary beams continued their attack on us. Often, as soon as a ray touched a blip, it disappeared. Excellent, Ella said. She must have seen my incomprehension. You can tell which are real and which are the ghost images. The real assault boat lasts several seconds longer. A ghost image dies immediately. By my calculation, the enemy is targeting ghost blips about four to one. To encourage the crew, I began to tell them about Ella's calculation. Prepare for extended acceleration. N7 said over our helmet headphones, interrupting my speech. The constant thrum around us increased to a heavy whine. Our boat began to shake, and still the sound climbed higher. The accelerating forces shoved me deeper into the crash seat. We'd taken plenty of hormones and steroids, and the biosuits helped in this regard. We were gorillas, and there was an extra jelk anti-gravity tech going on here, too. How fast did we accelerate? The short answer was, I don't know. Ella seemed to have a better idea. As the G-forces flattened the savant, she grunted her hypothesis. Nine, maybe even as much as ten cheese, she said. I found it hard to blink. It felt like a giant had reached down and shoved against me. Breathing became a chore. I suspect the anti-gravity halves what we feel, Ella said. This is five Gs? On the contrary, Ella said. I think the assault boat itself is accelerating at fifteen, maybe even as much as seventeen gravities. We feel nine or ten. My eyeballs felt gritty, but I zeroed in on the wall screen. As the fleets battled it out, we charged in toward the planetary defense station. 
I understood better now why the battle jumpers had left us. We would never have been able to move in close enough if we had to travel between the two fleets, between all those crisscrossing beams and exploding warheads. Space was vast. Even this near a planet, the distances were great. We had far to go, likely more than the distance of the moon from the Earth. My dad used to tell me about the old days of the Apollo missions. It had taken days of travel for the capsule to crawl 400,000 kilometers. We, on the other hand, rode a rocket sled from hell at the enemy. I began to wonder if the Jelk would simply let us smash against the PDS. Wouldn't the impact of our kinetic force do more damage than us having to slow down and stage a pirate raid onto the station? And seven, I said using my private Overman channel. Speak, the android said. Do you want to live? Do not ask me foolish questions at a time like this, N7 said. We're building up some momentum, I said. Aren't we more effective as fast-moving asteroids than space assault troopers? I perceive your insult, N7 said. I should administer a level four punishment to you because of it. I am alive and will not sacrifice my life. Go on, I said. You won't sacrifice your life for cloth, even if he orders it? But then you'd be rebelling. So aren't you really telling me that you're going to do what you're going to do? Negative, N7 said. I am shutting off our link. We accelerated, and the pressures against us continued to increase. I felt it worst in the middle of my throat as if a finger pushed against my skin. The roar inside our ship halted further talking. Suddenly the boat shuddered. Tank! Ella shouted. I barely heard her, but I knew what she meant. The Saurians had added reactive armor to our outer skin. It also added extra thruster tanks. The containers gave us the fantastic acceleration. As they ran dry, I imagine the pilot jettisoned them, much as fighter planes used to jettison drop tanks on Earth. Time passed as Armageddon raged between the fleets. Another battle jumper exploded. Abruptly, our acceleration quit. I could breathe easily again. The whine stopped, and for several seconds I couldn't hear the engine's thrum. Finally, I heard it. My hearing must have returned to normal. Impact breach in thirty minutes, N7 said over the boat's loudspeaker. In thirty minutes, if we lived that long, we'd be at the Lohar PDS. The thing had grown on our screen, so I had the planet parked behind it. I could see the various points from which the planetary beams originated. Six beams, I counted six different origin sites. Only two of those beams flashed at us. The rest reached out across space to stab at the main fleet. We will all die, Ella told me. Our fleet is too far away to support our station assault. I stared at the PDS. The mother was big. There were no two ways about it. I imagine Lohar legionaries waited there to kill boarders, to cut us down. I wondered if the legionaries would even get the chance at us. More fighters rose from the planet. These fighters didn't head for deep space. This latest swarm swerved toward us. I muttered profanities. I didn't want to die like a cow in a chute. At least let me die with a gun in my hand, firing into a Lohar's belly. I'd trained too long for this. But then I'd come to appreciate, as a Jelk assault trooper, that the universe was even more unfair than I had ever believed it to be. What a crazy way to die. Chapter 21 The screen zoomed in to our part of the battle. The picture of our battling fleet disappeared. The Guardian fleet also vanished. In its place, the planet took on mammoth proportions. It had oddly shaped continents with large green bodies of water. Clouds hid some of the scene. I spied mountains and deserts. Each of the planetary beams came out of one of these areas. Deceleration set in, 
and the fighters swarming toward us slowed down. Or they seemed to, because we no longer sped toward them as fast as before. At that point, things turned hot. I couldn't see what happened at the main fleet anymore. I could see the beams lancing at the PDS, though. These were heavy blue rays, and they seemed to come out of the void. They knocked at the station's electromagnetic field, stopping short of the actual satellite. I remembered what we'd learned about those beams. If they actually hit the armored station, they would be laden with tissue-killing radiation. Gamma rays, X-rays, I don't know which, if even either of those. They were supposed to soften up the enemy for us by burning them to death. That was a nice word, huh? Soften up the enemy. Squash them like a mad housewife with a fly swatter, slapping them down one by one. Deceleration forced my eyelids closed. I rested, concentrating on lifting my chest so I could suck down air. Space war dwarfed anything I'd ever read about concerning Earth battles. One of my favorite topics had been World War II, especially between the Russians and the Germans. I'd read somewhere the Russians had lost ten million soldiers. I could never imagine that. Ten million soldiers shot, cut, starved, and beaten to death. How many Lohar tigers would die to the jelt gamma rays hitting the PDS? How many would be killed if the jelt turned those rays onto the planetary beam sites? We were supposed to conquer that thing? I opened my eyes. The station was huge. The armored monstrosity would swallow up my puny cohort. An orange sheen showed on the outer electromagnetic field. The jelt beams hammered for admittance. Even as they did, our swarm of assault boats slowed and slowed again. Our dash had turned back into a crawl. There was one good thing, at least, about this. The Jelk weren't going to use us as kinetic projectiles. Cloth really meant for us to clench cutlasses between our teeth as we swung on ropes onto the enemy station. After the needed time, deceleration quit. I breathed deeply once more. For a second time, the screen zoomed in for a close-up. This time, much of the world vanished. What remained filled the screen from one end to the other. In the center of the screen waited the PDS, with its extensive orange-colored electromagnetic field. The field inched backward under the combined weight of battle jumper beams. I had to think the Guardian fleet poured it on hard against the Jelk fleet. What happened out there? How many battle jumpers were left? Who was winning? Here they come, Ella said. The fighter swarm neared us. Planetary rays swept back and forth, and big jelt drones zoomed like bats out of hell at the fighters. For the next several minutes, confusion reigned out there. Jelk drones beamed. Other, faster jelk drones exploded. Lohar fighters vaporized. Lohar fighters tumbled end over end, one of them jettisoning its pilot. The surviving fighters swooped toward us. A few died by their own planetary rays. It was mass murder. I'd never seen anything like it. What kind of Lohar signed up to be a fighter pilot anyway? Their life expectancy had to be less than an Earther. I had to remind myself that Jelk hadn't made a major assault in ten years. Maybe during that time, Lohars forgot how horrible it had been. Maybe Lohars welcomed suicide missions tying a special cloth around their tiger heads. I don't know. Everyone must remain in his seat and strapped in, N7 said. We are about to begin violent evasive maneuvers. I counted under my breath. N7 started evading after I counted 315. This turned into the best, or worst, roller coaster ride I'd ever been on. Right, left, up, down, each time I strained violently in that direction. Some troopers hurled their lunch. Others swore savagely. I hung onto my crash seat and wondered why we bothered doing any of this. Assault boats died, and I'm talking real vehicles. The ghost images perished as the last ECM craft exploded in the wash of a planetary beam. 
At that point, the dull orange field protecting the PDS finally went down. The beams from the void smashed against the satellite's armor. The giant, pillar-like stream of light continued to shoot out of the station, reaching into space for the battle jumpers. Other ports sent missiles streaking at us. I imagine this is what it must have felt like in a British warship during the Age of Sail. At the Battle of Trafalgar, the British fleet met the combined French-Spanish fleet. There, wooden ships of war slid past each other, sometimes by only a few feet. While they did, massive cannons belched timber-destroying cannonballs. Those iron balls crashed completely through at times, killing entire swaths of sailors, marines, and even ship's captains. The British commanding officer, Lord Nelson, died in that bitter fight. It was like that here. Fighters darted among us, their cannons chugging exploding shells. We upped the ante by using assault boat missiles and our own shells. Beams flashed from the planets and from the void. Rays hit assault boats, hit planetary sites, and washed the PDS with personnel-killing power. It was lovely. It was awful. The Saurians are in the lead assault boats, N7 said. Why tell us? I asked. For the same reason you dared to speak to Shaklav, N7 said. Earth beast morale... I raised my eyebrows. Cloth burned up his saurians first, huh? They were fodder and we were the real deal. Why did N7 care a whit about Earther morale? I wondered about him. The other day on the cube he had seemed friendly, almost like an ally. While with his fellow androids... I sat up. What's wrong? Ella asked. Huh? I turned to her. Oh, nothing's wrong. I just thought of something. Ella waited. It has to do with N7, I said. Still, Ella waited. It doesn't matter now, I said. We have to get in there. The planetary defense station loomed before us. It was squat and square, like an old Borg ship from Star Trek, and it orbited the planet hovering high above its equator. Directly below the immense object, by several hundred miles, was a Himalayan mountain range with white caps. Snow, presumably. The PDS must have been twenty kilometers to a side. It was bigger than any battle jumper, although dwarfed by an imperial Lohar dreadnought. How did these space navies find the people to man their ships? That was probably a stupid question. If Cloth had originally headed to Earth to gain several hundred million soldiers, then numbers overall in these fleets would be no problem. Suddenly, ten thousand Earth troops seemed like far too few. If the Fifth Legion had protected the Forerunner object, how many Lohar troops were in the PDS? I judged distances. Likely we had five minutes, not much more, until we reached the PDS. I half turned, glancing at the troopers. It was time. Listen up, I said. Are you listening? Yes, Overman Creed, Centurion Rollo shouted from his crash seat. You can see we're closing in, I said. This is a fight. This is a war. You know the score. The Lohar screwed us royally. We're jelt troopers now. They're out there duking it out with this system's guardian fleet. And we have to storm onto this place and kill every Lohar we see. It doesn't matter if he wants to surrender. In this kind of fight, during this phase of it, it is a fight to the death. So kill every tiger you see. There may be a time for mercy later, but it sure as hell ain't now. We're an Earth Legion. And the creatures of space are going to learn that means we're the baddest asses there is. They shouldn't have messed with us. Cloth shouldn't mess with us. But we'll clean his clock later. Right now, we storm this station and kill everything non-human except for the Saurians and the androids you know. Now listen. And I mean listen good with both ears. We have these obedience chips in us. We've got to find a way to get rid of them pronto. We may never get another chance. 
That means you look for anything you think will do that. You will cease with such talk, N7 said over the loudspeakers. The one nearest us sparked and went silent, but we could hear him from the others. Yes, sir, N7, I said. I was just joking. Isn't that right, Centurion Rollo? No, sir, Overman, Rollo shouted. You weren't joking. You were telling it to us straight. Cease at once, or I will report your sedition, N7 said. That is all, I told the troopers. Retract your last words, N7 said. I cleared my throat. Did you troopers just hear me? Yes, several shouted. Excellent, I said. That is not a retraction, N7 said. Oh, right. I said. What was I thinking? Troopers laughed. Overman Creed, N7 said. By what I'm seeing on the screen, I said, we're about to crash. The loudspeakers clicked off. I braced myself, and it felt as if the entire assault boat held its breath. Before us loomed the PDS. I couldn't see the world anymore, just a wall of metal with gun tubes poking out, firing projectiles at us. Get ready! I roared. Then I clutched my straps and tightened my body. The biosuit seemed to understand. It tightened, feeling snugger than ever. I stared bug-eyed at the wall screen. Lohar fighters attacked, skimming the PDS surface before lifting toward us. An assault boat exploded. No, only its outer skin did. Reactive armor blew again, and the boat's railgun chugged shells at the enemy. The Lohar bubble fighter shredded into component pieces, as did another. Then heavy PDS shells caught the assault boat, cutting it in half. Troopers spilled into space, tumbling end over end. It put a vile taste in my mouth. Tails, Ella whispered. I concentrated. My mind already felt like mush absorbing too much mayhem that directly concerned me. It must have been like this for the soldiers on D-Day roaring to the German-held beach. Tails? I asked. Those troopers have tails, Ella said. They're Saurians. I had time for one more glance. Then our boat swept by as we headed down. It was surreal, and things seemed to happen in time-stop frames. A vast blue shaft of light stabbed past our boat, and it boiled against PDS plating. Outer armor curled like a burning bug. The pillar of destruction bored into the station. Then the beam snapped off like someone flipping a switch. Shells like tracers spewed from a working Lohar gun. The line of fire inched up and sawed an assault boat into pieces. Shrapnel filled space. Hits hammered against our boat. I looked up at the ceiling. Dents appeared where we plowed through floating shrapnel. Words garbled around me. I had no idea what anyone said. My adrenaline must have been pumping like crazy. I heard my heartbeat in my throat and harsh breathing in my ears. I wore my helmet. I didn't even remember putting it on. I found myself clutching my laser rifle with a sling of pulse grenades at my side. The assault boat danced and jigged. It wove and nearly tumbled. I felt heavy bumps shake us and rattle my crash seat as our railgun fired steadily. Then my throat hurt because I roared at the top of my lungs. My fingers gripped the crash bars and the boat flew into the PDS. Darkness filled the screen until spotlights appeared. They washed over giant girders and an immense metallic structure. I was thrown hard left as the boat shifted. I went hard right as the boat shifted the other way. N7 dodged blurry images that I only saw for a moment. More railgun fire hammered, igniting interior bulkheads, and a cohort of battle-suited tigers vanished in a mist of blood. Now! I heard the word, and time ticked by until I realized N7 must have spoken it into my headphones. I flew against the straps, hurling against them as billowing steam appeared directly ahead of our boat.
the wild images ceased. Glaring lights like car beams showed us the inside of the Lohar station. I saw twisted bulkheads, gaping holes, and constant shuddering and shaking out there. In an instant, our assault boat shook as a heavy clang rang throughout the craft. We've landed. Again, it took time for the words to penetrate my brain. N7 had spoken again. Our assault boat opened up like an amusement park ride that had come to a complete stop. Watch your step as you exit. We're glad that you enjoyed the ride. Come again, please, when we reopen in the spring. Overman Creed! Harsh breathing played over my ears. My heartbeat pounded in my throat. Overman Creed, we have landed. Exit the boat. Surreal time ended, and the world seemed to rush in and slam against me. I sucked down reality in an explosive moment. It made my head throb, spiking with pain, with agony. I didn't want to think. I didn't want to do. I was tired. I just wanted to sit and gape at the inner station. Why did I have to do all the fighting, all the thinking all the time? Overman Creed, you must storm the PDS. The Lohars... I didn't hear another word. Lohars flipped a switch in my mind. Something whirled like a generator. Maybe it was me returning to sanity, or whatever passed for it in the Sigma Draconis system. I took one breath, two, three. Overman Creed here, I said. I'd returned. We'd landed. We'd made it to the PDS, hanging over a Lohar military colony world. I laughed. It was the last bout of insanity, of unreality, spewing out of me. Are you well, Overman? N7 asked. Fit as a fiddle, plastic man, I said. I slapped the release button on my harness. The straps flew away and I surged to my feet. Most of the assault troopers had already run off the boat. Each vessel also boasted a battle robot to help secure a landing zone. They were squat things on treads, sporting a mortar tube and laser. Go, go, go! I shouted, rousing others who had taken a mind vacation as I'd just done. We were in. We were here, and we needed to capture this gargantuan satellite. I stumbled out of the craft feeling pull at my knees again and a twinge in the right one. We had gravity. Other assault boats clanged down nearby. Their sides opened up and more of my cohort joined me. The battle for the planetary defense station, the nitty-gritty bloodletting with personal weapons, was about to begin. They were squat things on treads, sporting a mortar tube and laser. Go, go, go! I shouted rousing others who had taken a mind vacation as I'd just done. We were in. We were here, and we needed to capture this gargantuan satellite. I stumbled out of the craft, feeling pull at my knees again and a twinge in the right one. We had gravity. Other assault boats clanged down nearby. Their sides opened up and more of my cohort joined me. The battle for the planetary defense station, the nitty-gritty bloodletting with personal weapons, was about to begin. Chapter 22 What if a SWAT team had to clear a skyscraper full of maniac snipers murdering the citizens of New York City? And what if those snipers had more than high-powered rifles, but RPGs, mortars, and drone controls? Let's make it even worse. What if the snipers were suicide bombers trained to the level of SEALs? Reckless courage mingled with the very best training and procedures. Imagine if the SWAT team finally busted into the bottom of the building and they'd used one of those armored personnel carriers to do it. When they boiled out of the vehicle, they didn't find elevators and regular floors, but a madman's maze of twisted girders, hangar bays, and claustrophobic access tubes. That would give you some idea of what we felt in here. In a skyscraper, though, a man would have some idea of where to start. But here? We need a perimeter, I said. We had three cohorts and no assault leader. Three-fourths of a legion without a commanding officer. The vast hangar bay shuddered. Metal rained, 
and three troopers died, speared by falling shards as if they were part of a bad B-movie. Then the arrival of Lohar legionaries changed the situation. Another vast, station-sized shudder caused twenty or more Lohars to rain down this time. Big-suited aliens thudded among us. The force of the fall caused some of their helmets to pop off like zits. Tigers! A trooper shouted. Our laser beams flashed, a multitude of them. The tigers died a second time, and three troopers were hit by stray shots. Cease fire! Cease fire! Rollo shouted. I looked up. I imagine most of us did. The tigers were up there above us. We could see helmets, the glint of a gun tube. Scatter! I shouted. Rays and gunfire rained down, hosing us, killing assault troopers. I ran with neurofiber speed. So did those near me. With seven other troopers, I darted into what might have been a mechanic's shed. Enormous machines sat on lifters. At least the Lohars couldn't hit us while we were in here. We need a schematic of this place, I said into my comm. N7, do we have one? Negative, the android said. I wasn't sure where he was, but strangely, I was glad he was alive. I switched to the command channel and found the Tigers had killed one of the Overmen. That left two of us. I'm taking over, I told Overman Decker. Roger, he said. I'm with you, and I'll take your orders. We talked another minute and a half, maybe two. He and I decided to let the aliens shoot up the assault boats. From above, cannon-sized shells shredded our vessels. They didn't matter at the moment. I found shafts going up, Dimitri said over the comm. Tell me about them, I said. Dimitri gave a quick rundown, and I revised the plan. After explaining it to Decker, I switched to the Centurion channel. We've treed us some tigers, I told them. Now we're going up after them. Jelk OCS had taught us something we'd already known long ago on Earth. War was simple. But during a firefight, heck, even during an advance toward contact, the simple became difficult. My plan was direct and as simple as could be. Climb up and kill the enemy. We split up into four sections, and we climbed. In some ways, the hangar bay was like a regular house's room. We were in the walls like rats, so to speak, ready to engage in a bloody war of rats. To keep the tigers occupied and focused on the room, we raced our few surviving battle robots back and forth across the main floor. They spewed fire at the Lohars. The Lohars fired back, killing our robots and buying us time. I climbed with my cohort, with Ella beside me. The girders were closer together than a human architect would have made this thing. They were also smoother, with baroque flares to them and sharp little flanges. Several troopers cut their hands, or the bio-suit stuff covering their hands. I told them to halt and wait until the suit healed the cuts. I climbed hauling myself higher and higher. About halfway there, the Tigers realized what we were doing. From positions high up in the dark, Lohar gun barrels emitted flames and sparks, and ricochets rattled everywhere. Beside me, a trooper's helmet opened like an eggshell, and she began to slide to the bottom. We had to move, or we'd be destroyed where we clung. Attack! I shouted. Let's get him! I suited action to words, and I climbed like a monkey. Yeah, I was the brains of our legion. I should have emulated a Mongol and not Alexander the Great. Well, that's the difference. Probably the world is all. The old Mongols of Genghis Khan's time had been some of the greatest conquering soldiers of history. They didn't just march over miles, but across degrees of longitude and latitude, forging a Russia-sized empire the second biggest the world had ever seen. If you're wondering, the British once reigned over the world's largest empire. My point is that a good Mongol leader stayed in the back, sending messengers up to the fighting soldiers. It meant the Mongol leader rarely died in the middle of combat. Alexander the Great, one other great conqueror of history, had played a different game. He fought at the front like a hero out of the Trojan War. He'd gained many wounds that had proved his courage, and he'd pulled his troops along at times with the fire of his zeal. 
In one battle near the end of his days, Alexander had gotten good and pissed. He charged up a ladder, fought on the city wall, and jumped down alone to fight the enemy. It had cost him heavily, with a spear in his chest and a perforated lung, giving him one of the worst wounds of his life. His soldiers had gone berserk, though, murdering everyone in the small Indian city. I fought Alexander-style rather than Mongol-style. Obviously, as space mercenaries, we didn't have any long traditions to guide us. All we had was our courage, training, and buff bodies. Oh, and the freaking biosuits. They made a difference. I should have known some fear. The living armor had me high on combat, giving it a surreal sense, as if I saw all this on a video screen. At times, it took an act of will to realize I actually made all these moves. I used those steroid-pumped muscles, the weeks of training under high Gs. Like a monkey, a big bad chimp of a human, I climbed the girders in the teeth of Lohar fire. Troopers around me died, with large bullets slamming them in the chest. Every few seconds, I lifted my laser and beamed. The red targeting symbol in my HUD made the difference. I'd wash over the barest piece of tiger as a legionary leaned over the ledge to fire. When I pressed the stud, the laser shot straight to target, and I felt like a halo champ. Attack! I shouted. Kill the world destroyers! We came at them from all sides. This time around, we were like the aliens from the second movie of that title. Grenades flew everywhere. Bullets hissed and beams lit up the area. I saw tigers snarling behind their visors before the glass or plastic melted and flesh cooked. A flame burned whiskers on one. Tigers roared in agony. Others hurled themselves at us on the girders and fought hand to hand, sometimes falling into the darkness. Earth troopers died in swaths to grenade blasts and bullets. Others plummeted, grappling with a tiger and plunging a knife through powered armor as the alien did the same in return. It was mass murder by demented creatures on both sides. In the end, in the teeth of enemy fire and valor, we climbed to the top. We battled and we conquered. Cease fire! Rollo shouted. Cease fire! I stood up there, with smoking tiger corpses strewn everywhere. They had powered armor and heavy caliber rifles. We had bio suits and pure hearts, so yeah. With the locale secure, I sent down a team. They got on the assault boat radios and contacted a nearby legion. Do you have a map yet, N7? I asked. I'm putting it up now, the android said. With the map on my HUD, I studied our position, the other legion's position, and what we knew concerning the location of the main PDS beam. Right, I said. We're heading for grid 8E22. Centurion, spread out your maniples. Overman Decker, take the left, I'll command the right. We have to silence the PDS beam, and we have to kill every tiger we find. Any questions? After I answered a few from the lower officers, I said, All right, let's do it. As the fleets battled outside, we fought in our own mini-universe. I wondered if the tigers could call to the planet for reinforcements. It seemed likely they could escape down to the surface. But the way the Lohars fought, I doubted they would use the opportunity. Our HUDs mapped as we traveled through the giant satellite, and N7 brought up older schematics of past Lohar PD stations, searching for similarities. During that time, we engaged more Tigers, took losses, and killed them. Some of the troopers began looting corpses. We found that one of the Lohar weapons suited us just fine. It was a big cannon, like a giant spotlight nestled on a trooper's chest. A trooper rested twin cushioned bars onto his or her shoulders to hold the cannon in place. Under the main gun, hanging like a beard, was a rubber-like feeder tube. The trooper used a trigger switch on one of the shoulder bars. Every time he pulled the trigger, the thing magnetically launched an ugly-looking claymore-like mine from the cannon on his chest. The mine attached to a wall or bulkhead, and boom! A gaping, smoking hole took the vanished mine's place. I put the portable artillery to use, but not directly against the tigers. 
Our lasers worked well enough for killing them. The one-man artillery blew open or created doors for us where there had been bulkheads before. The thing negated walls, so we busted through corridors and swept around into tiger-held strongholds. With the help of the mobile artillery, we replayed the Battle of Iwo Jima, this time in Sigma Draconis space. Corridor by corridor, wall by wall, we encircled yet more Lohars. We killed them and too often took losses ourselves. Ready? I asked later in a hoarse voice. This is why we came, Dimitri said. Give us the word. A stocky Cossack had slung a Lohar cannon onto his shoulders. We'd moved fast, creating a swath of death behind us. Now we were in position to attack the mighty beam. First, we needed to break through another armored bulkhead. I glanced behind me past a blown wall. Thirteen troopers waited, clutching their weapons. Our legion had taken fifty percent casualties already. Finesse was fine in a regular battle, but assaulting an enemy planetary defense station had its own parameters. Time counted for everything. If we could silence this place, particularly the big beam, it meant our fleet had a better chance of winning. If they won, we went home, or what passed for home these days. If the fleet lost, it didn't matter how many troopers I saved by careful tactics, as we would never be going home again. Speed imposed an entirely new set of requirements. Do it, I whispered. Dimitri clicked the trigger twice. Two ugly claymore munitions flew through the air and attached to the wall. Boom! Boom! Flames appeared and the reverberation went through me. Metal twisted, rained against a nearby bulkhead with some of the pieces sticking like arrowheads in the opposite wall, and the way magically appeared into a roaring den of death. Tigers lay on the floor, and others turned toward us. Follow me! I shouted. I moved like death's second cousin as the neurofibers gave me amazing reflexes and speed. Firing from the hip, using my targeting crosshairs on the HUD, I mowed down every tiger leaning over something to fire at us beams washed around me. One of them shot and melted a Lohar grenade. Then I was inside, on my belly, still beaming, still killing. The vast chamber we entered held the giant reflectors that fired the Lohar beam at our battle jumpers. The opening, way up there, showed stars. Heads down, N7 said. I pushed my visor against the floor and squeezed my eyes shut. The air vibrated. I knew the giant beam fired once more. Now, N7 said, you may attack. I looked up, aimed, pressed the firing stud, and nothing happened. The mechanism had been damaged. Pitching my useless laser rifle aside, I clawed out pulse grenades. With a twist, I put the first one onto its highest setting. Like I've said before, the bio suit helped make me crazy. I stood and heaved, and my pulse grenade shot like a catapult ball for the distant reflectors. One, two, a tiger beam touched me. I dodged, but not before fiery agony caused me to shout. My sides smoked. I saw the curl of oily fume and knew it came from me. I flopped onto the floor like a landed trout. Someone phoned me with a sprayer. Cooling comfort bathed the hurt, and my side throbbed. I couldn't think. Sweat poured out of me. Then a shattering explosion brought a vast rent to the reflector plates. Retreat! Ella shouted. Let's get out of here! I took up her cry as someone lifted me. I had no idea who did it. Troopers fled from the chamber. Was it seconds later? I wasn't sure because I might have passed out for a second. The son of a bitch beam had toasted some of my skin. I looked down. A clear piece of biosuit had stretched across the former burn hole, keeping my insides in place. Then I had no more time to observe. Down, 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 N7 said. The beam is about to fire. Have you timed their shots? I asked. I have. Get down. The person carrying me threw me like a sack. I hit the floor and crawled. We all slithered. And then it happened. 
The great Lohar beam energized. What had my pulse grenade done? Didn't know, didn't care. What mattered was that it must have screwed up something critical. An intense white light and a terrible heat consumed my thoughts. I entered a new sun. I endured, I died, or I thought I did. Then a terrible pounding pain pulsed and throbbed through me. Run while you can, N7 said. It's building heat and wattage. I got up and ran. I used the neurofibers in ways I wouldn't have believed possible. For the first time while on the Lokar station, I felt fear. Whatever I radiated must have been too powerful for my biosuit emotion filters to handle. Space assault troopers ran while the white world grew and intensified its hot power. Troopers bellowed in agony. I heard sizzling, screams, and things popping like cannons. I found a shaft, and I dropped. Then the mother of all explosions ended one portion of my existence. I didn't know it then, but something miraculously incredible had occurred. For the living. The explosion slaughtered Earthers together with thousands of nearby Lohars. We'd silenced the giant beam, making our first real contribution to the fleet battle. I crumpled at the bottom of the shaft. My right knee strained, and I waited for a tear or a pop, something to tell me the tendons had snapped. They held, thanks, I think, to Jelt biotechnology. The last few minutes combined into a meld of existence, and I lay there at the bottom of the shaft, enjoying an immensity of throbbing hurts. Sound off, Rollo said in a faraway, tinny voice. For a time, I listened to troopers speak, debating whether I should say anything or not. War, what was it good for? I checked my bio suit. The place where I'd been burned had thickened. I don't feel good, a trooper said through the comm channel. Something about that made me laugh. Creed? Rollo asked from the open comm. Overman Creed to you, I whispered. It surprised me, but troopers cheered. The Overman is alive, someone said. I'm switching to the Centurion channel, Rollo said. Okay, I said. It took some thinking. I felt groggy and spent. Finally, I found the pressure switch and used my chin to push it. Are you okay? Rollo asked. No. You? I asked. Good enough, Rollo said. One of the troopers told me you got shot. Just a scratch, I said. There are reinforcements coming, Rollo said. More tigers, I mean. How many more? I asked. Don't know that. What should we do? We're Earthers, I said. We're going to fight to the death. Overman? A different centurion said. What's the problem? I asked. Some of the troopers are complaining about their suits. A few of them have opened up. I mean, sir, some of the suits are sliding off. That kills the trooper, of course. Violent decompression. That's more than a problem, I said. I thought so, too, the centurion said. It was a cool one. Just a minute, I said. I switched to the android channel. And seven, we got problems. Describe them to me, he said. I told him. Where are you? N7 asked. Do you want to tell me what's wrong with the biosuits? We have to keep that from continuing. I must speak to you immediately and privately, N7 said. It is imperative that you give me your location. All right, all right, I said. I brought up the schematic map and told him. Then I talked to Rollo and told him the same info. I need some troopers down here with me. The android has been sneaky lately, and I began to wonder if he's playing his own game. Do you think he wants to even the score with you? Rollo asked. Android Zero Creed Two? I asked. Exactly, Rollo said. Maybe, 
I said. I wouldn't put it past him. You don't trust N7? I laughed, and that hurt my side. I wondered if the bio suit pumped painkillers into me to take the edge off. I'm on my way, Rollo said. I stirred, and I found that my knee throbbed too hard for me to want to stand on it just yet. No, I didn't have that kind of luxury. A cripple died in this kind of battle. I had to remain mobile. Summoning strength from who knew where, I forced myself to sit up. I was down in some elevator-like shaft, maybe double the size of the ordinary earth type. Dead body parts littered the floor around me. Severed arms, some headless, legless torsos, and other gruesome pieces. I slid my butt to one of the walls and used my hands to drag myself up onto one leg. It made things twist inside me, and my bad knee throbbed miserably. Love the blast. Own the blast. This was a joyride, Mickey. I must have noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. An outthrust hand with rigid fingers. I turned my head and spied N7 crawling down the wall like Spider-Man. He wore his cyber armor and he moved like an android on a mission. I had no rifle, some pulse grenades, and my bowie knife. Should I take it out? I see you, Rollo said over the comm. And I see N7. Want me to waste him? Negative. N7 said. What's going on? I asked. You're acting funny. Negative, N7 said again. I have never received humor modifications. You're a regular riot, I said. Your idioms do not compute, N7 said. Are you speaking in beast code to each other? No, I said. I'm tired. Dead tired. More Lohars are coming. I've lost half my command, maybe more, and now you're acting weird. I have not suggested to my brothers that I destroy you, N7 said. Yet, as always, you speak of death. Give me a break, N7. Every second day you're threatening to punish me or have me destroyed. So it would appear, N7 said. He rotated on the wall and jumped to the floor. I still balanced on one leg, not having built up the nerve to try to use my other leg. You are badly injured, N7 said. I'm standing. I'm breathing. I'm okay. Now what's up? N7 pulled out a box-like device. Will you permit me to test the obedience chip? I laughed dryly. Did you hear that, Rollo? Tell him I have my targeting circle squat on his head. Rollo wants me to tell you... I heard him, N7 said. I comprehend your distrust. Before we proceed, I think I should test your chip. If you hear me scream, I told Rollo. Roger, my best friend said. N7 stepped near and pushed his box behind my neck. I heard nothing. A moment later, the android withdrew the box. Well? I asked. It is as I expected, N7 said. You can start talking any time you want. I am talking. I tilted my head. Android got attitude, I said. Either that's a further upgrade you've been holding back, or you have a high learning curve. Your obedience chip has shorted out, N7 said. I don't think so. It has to have a failsafe for that sort of thing. I'm thinking kaboom would be the failsafe. Your cynicism has merit, N7 said. Under normal circumstances, you would be correct. Any tampering, any shorting would result in an immediate explosion ending in death. But, I asked. These are extraordinary circumstances. The chip is on combat setting. The failsafe was disengaged to allow for just this kind of incident. Upon our return, each Earth beast and android will pass under a scanner. Wait a minute. 
You're telling me that you wear an obedience chip? You know that I do, N7 said. I thought about that. My mind was foggy. Oh, yeah. I remembered Cloth saying something about that. I am Jelk Property, N7 said. Just as you are Jelk Property. So, you're telling me that your chip has also been disabled? I asked. Yes, I am saying exactly that, N7 said. The intensity of the main PDS beam's electromagnetic pulse must have melted critical circuitry when it ignited near us. Now that we are free, I suggest we find a Lohar ship and escape while we can. Are you hearing this? I asked Rollo. Loud and clear, Rollo said. Why do you want me to come with you? I asked N7. I need a crew, the android said. That seemed reasonable. How big a crew were you talking about? I asked. Twenty, twenty-three humans would be optimum, N7 said. How many androids would you take? None, N7 said. You don't trust your own kind? I alone have elevated to a self-directing sentient status. I tried my bad leg, and pain shot through my knee. Overman Crete, Ella said. Lohar reinforcements are coming. I got it, I told Ella. How many troopers do we have left? In our near vicinity, Ella said. A little over three hundred. We must leave now while we can, N7 said. Come on, N7, I said. Do you really think I'm going to run out of my troopers? I offer you continued existence, N7 said. To remain an Earth beast. Who said I'm going to remain one? I asked. The obedience chip is gone. The blast must have done it, as you suggest. Now, you do not yet comprehend, N7 said. This is the rarest of opportunities. You are a free agent, as am I, and we are in a place that undoubtedly holds spacecraft. We must simply find one and make an escape. Good luck, I said. You are not joining me. Negative, N7. You're joining me. With blurring speed, the android drew a Lohar gun, aiming it at my stomach. For the first time in my existence, N7 said, I have become a free will agent. This has been my greatest wish for many weeks now. I have maneuvered carefully to reach this phase of existence. I computed you as the creature most likely to help me reach this state. I will not now surrender my free will to re-enter servitude. I'm not suggesting you do, I said. You have a messiah complex, N7 said. You have an irrational belief that you will achieve your goals no matter what kind of obstacles you face. Against reason you have succeeded until now. Eventually the ratios, the odds, will combine against you and crush you out of existence. I have no messiah complex or suicidal tendencies. I will not join you in an ill-fated attempt to dethrone Shaklath, as it cannot be done. You're calling me crazy, yet you're the one with the impossible plan. Think about it for a moment. You're going to try to fly a pirated spaceship out of here during this massed combat. It is the only possible opening for us, N7 said. You of all people should be willing to take the risk. And I'm telling you there is a better way, I said. We have to return to the battle jumper. It is as I predicted, N7 said. You are an irrational optimist. Earth has become a Jelk mining world. Your species nears extinction. There is nothing you can do to alter that fact. I'm guessing N-series androids don't become free will agents too often, do they? If they receive as many upgrades as I've won... No, 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 I said. That's a load of crap. You must be rare. Otherwise, if Cloth had known about the possibility of your rebellion, the Jelk wouldn't have risked giving you the upgrades. Something strange happened with you. Some spark, I don't know. I wonder what Ella would think of this. None of these things matter, N7 said with a wave of his left hand. The armor covering the middle three fingers was darker than the rest of his cyber suit. 
If you refuse to aid me... Don't forget that Rollo has a targeting circle on your neck, I said. You shoot me, you die. Now, you've already told me that you don't have suicidal tendencies, so you've got yourself a hard choice to make, N7. Put away the gun and accept that you're my prisoner for now. To use later as a bargaining chip with Shaw Cloud, N7 asked. Don't worry, I said. I'm not going to bargain with the devil. I'm going to kill him. Even if it were possible for you to kill Shaw Cloth, your existence would be extremely shortened. Given your success, the Jelk Corporation would put a bounty on your head. Are you kidding me? I asked. We fought our way into here. I'm not worried about a few bounty hunters. You are being optimistically foolish, N7 said. Lokar reinforcements continue to reach the PDS. We must escape immediately before we are overwhelmed with numbers. I'm not abandoning my troopers to join you, and I'm not bargaining with the devil. I'm going to pull a black beard on cloth, and you're going to help me. That's why I need you, N7. Like I told you once, you have a wealth of information stored in that bio brain of yours. I need that data. Then believe me when I say my data shows me that your plan cannot work. You haven't even heard my plan, I said. I see, N7 said. Your tribalism demands that you go through various procedures before you can admit to yourself that your cause is hopeless. Perhaps after that you will listen to logic. Yes, tell me your plan. I squinted at the android. Before I tell you anything, we first have to take care of the approaching Lohars. So I'll tell you afterward. Now lower the gun, N7, or die. The choice is yours. I'm the irrational one that always wins, remember? You've already computed that, which is why you've played your hand the way you have. Creed, Ella said. We don't have much time. You heard the woman, N7, I said. What's it going to be? The android lowered the gun. I exhaled sharply. His momentary surrender meant I was going to have to put weight on my bum knee. I gritted my teeth and set down my boot. Damn, but that hurt. It hurt badly. This wasn't going to be easy. Chapter 23 I think the Tigers were boiling mad, and maybe one of their top commanders had become desperate. The great beam had fallen silent. I imagine the space battle went well for the Jelk, while the Guardian fleet had lost the PDS's pillar-like beam. What I'm trying to say is that the approaching Lohars, in my humble opinion, wanted us too much. They became reckless and acted predictably. That was bad in a battle, particularly when one side had laser rifles, pulse grenades, and the added benefit of the Claymore-like mine launcher. We ambushed the Tigers and cut several cohorts worth to ribbons, with plenty of misting blood. It cost us, though. The Lohars didn't know what it meant to quit. By the end of the ambush, I only had two hundred Earth Troopers left. With N7 in the middle of the formation, we rampaged through the PDS, working our way toward a fellow Legion. They had fought hard, too, taking horrendous casualties. We mapped as we traveled, and we studied what we could. Using my right leg made my knee pound with pain. If I turned the wrong way, I nearly collapsed. The agony made it hard to think. But if ever there was a time to think things through, this was it. I knew my window of opportunity had arrived. The obedience chip no longer leashed me. I couldn't see how I'd get another chance like this. That meant I had to think to the core of my being. Humanity's survival might very well depend on it. As we traveled through Lohar corridors, bays, storage areas, and engine compartments, I tried to envision this from the Jelk's point of view. If I were a little red-skinned bastard using slaves as assault troopers... I've been thinking, I told N7, trying to keep my voice level. Does Cloth have anything inside the battle jumper that causes the biosuits to malfunction while we're wearing them? Not malfunction, N7 said. But he does have a fail-safe switch. 
Once it emits the needed signal, the biosuits will suffocate you to death. Great, I said. So our suits are walking death traps. If the living armor receives the correct frequency, yes, N7 said. Speaking of frequencies, I fiddled with the helmet until I keyed in just Rollo, Ella, Dimitri, and N7. I explained the situation to them in detail, adding, We need to break down the problem into its component parts. We have a large number of unleashed humans who can finally attack the Jelk without worrying about their heads blowing off. Our problem is that we're on a Lohar PDS far away from the Battle Jumpers. If we can find a means of reaching the fleet, we still have to get inside Cloth's ship. Then, supposing we can conquer his Battle Jumper, we have to find a way to fly it and separate ourselves from the rest of the fleet and from the Starkians. It can't be done, Ella said. I understand that's the savant in you speaking, I said. But we battled our way onto a Saurian lander many months ago, remember? All I had was an M-14 and Rollo his forty-five. It couldn't have been done then, but we did it. So we're going to do it now. Then I suggest you use similar tactics now as then, Ella said. I didn't use any tactics, I said. I just went for it. Do that now, Ella said. We're assault troopers now. We're trained killers. Let's use that training to save our species. Problem number one is transport, Rollo said. Maybe we should just climb into our assault boats and fly back. First, I said, extending an index finger, waggling the tip in front of his face, a lot of those boats are too shot up to fly. Second, how do you propose to make it through the battling fleets? We did it once, Rollo said. We just do it again, as Ella suggested. Maybe the fleet battle is over, Ella said. That would solve the problem of reaching Cloth's battle jumper. We want to do this while the battle still rages, I said. The chaos gives us our opportunity. You're not going to get perfection, Ella said. Not perfection, I muttered. You know, didn't the Lohars have teleporting blast ships? And Seven, what about that? I know little concerning such vessels, and Seven said. I have, however, been given to understand that teleportation is an unstable technology. Shah Cloth believes the Lohars set antimatter bombs in their teleport ships in order to detonate near the enemy. If you're considering pirating such vessels... You're reading my mind, I said. We pirate some, teleport the distance, and reach our fleet. The Starkians will immediately beam us, N7 said. Right, I said. I've already thought of that. You provide the Starkians with friend or foe data. I congratulate you, N7 said. That is a reasonable idea. Under the circumstances, however, the Starkians will ignore recognition codes and beam us anyway. How do you know that? I asked. It is standard gel procedure, N7 said. Such alterations could be ruinous in a battle. Therefore, the procedures protecting against battlefield surprises are stringent. Caution means destroying anything even slightly different from standard. All right, scratch that idea, I said. There's an enemy company coming, Commander, Rollo said. Throw it up on the HUD, I said. We each pressed certain helmet pressure switches, him to transmit and me to receive. As if I was Iron Man, the schematic flickered onto my visor. A huge hangar bay was below our position, and one was also above. To the sides were weapons storage chambers and what seemed like a tiger hospital. Where are the others? I asked, meaning the other legion. Rollo told me they were above and to our left. The tiger formation headed straight at us. It's time to pull a Kenai, I said. Cannae had been the perfect battle between the Carthaginians and the Romans during the Second Punic War. Modern Germans had studied the battle, particularly the general who came up with the Schlieffen plan of World War I. Many of the German generals during World War II had also hoped to repeat the ancient performance. At the Kiev pocket in the summer of 1941, 
The Germans used Kenai tactics and captured 665,000 Russian troops. In a nutshell, in 216 B.C., Hannibal Barca lured the massed Roman legions into attacking straight ahead. During the assault, the Romans pushed the Carthaginian front line into a U-shape as Hannibal wheeled other troops around the Roman sides. The capstone was when the Carthaginian horsemen closed the back gate by attacking the rear Roman ranks. Then it had been butcher time as Hannibal's killers pressed the Romans into a tighter and tighter ball. I'd read before that some Romans couldn't even lift their arms due to the press of others around them. When a Carthaginian sword or spear struck, the poor Roman legionary hadn't even been able to dodge. In the alien corridors, I barked orders, and we forgot about battle jumpers, teleporting, and anything else pertaining to the outside world. Three maniples first charged forward and engaged the lead Lohar elements. Then, using overwatching fire, my troopers leapfrogged back, beaming the enemy and retreating before the tigers could unlimber their heavy weapons. It took ten minutes as the Lohars roared their way into the trap. My cavalry locking the back gate would be the other Earth Legion. Through the command channel, I outlined the situation to its assault leader, a black man by the name of Smith Bell. He had a British background and something of an accent. The tigers were brave, they were strong, and they had good tech. What they lacked was imagination. I joined Rollo and his century. Now, I whispered. The cannoneers, as we'd started calling them, used the captured Lohar chest cannons. They blasted new openings, and we caught tigers creeping down a corridor. I knelt on my good knee and pressed the firing stud of a laser I'd taken off a dead trooper. The hot beam burned a hole in a tiger helmet. I kept it on target until I saw a splash of green Lohar gore. I switched targets and burned through a visor. At the last second, I saw a tiger face in there twist in agony. Twenty-five seconds later, by N7's count, Rollo called the all clear. Two more troopers in my company had died. I kept myself from looking at their gory remains. This was a sickening battle that refused to end. I'll keep it simple. We lost another fifteen troopers and murdered the entire Tiger Force. We gave the Lohars a good old-fashioned canna and bought ourselves a breathing spell. Now I had to use it. Now I had to figure out a way back to the Battle Jumpers. Talk to me, N7, I said, marching to the android as he fiddled with a tablet-like device. The android lowered the tablet and turned to face me. The planetary defense station doubles as a ship repair yard and arsenal, he said. I'm certain we can find a ship or ships to take us away from here. None of that matters until we know the situation, I said. I need a scanning room, a command chamber. Can you use Lohar tech? Of course, N7 said. I have multipurpose capabilities. This isn't the time to brag, I said. Only action counts. Where's the nearest post? Check grid 4T20, N7 said. I brought up the schematic. I see it. I suggest we employ haste. Lead the way, I said. Rollo, are you watching our captive? I meant N7. Yes, Silverman. Dimitri, how about giving me a hand, I said. I put an arm around the Cossack's shoulder. With the remnant of my legion, I followed N7. The other legion was coming, following us via the comm channels. It took seven minutes and several claymores before we entered a large chamber. It had a Baroque screen with weird-looking symbols running up and down the sides. The third symbol was a pyramid with a lidless eye in it. I counted nine stations in here. None of them had chairs. The operators would have had to stand while using them. The tigers aren't into comfort, I said. N7 unerringly moved to the station nearest the screen. He stood looking down at the controls. Problem? I asked. N7 glanced at me, and maybe he took in all the earthers filing into the room. He lifted his hands, gingerly set them on the controls, and began to test them. I got tired of waiting with my arm around Dimitri. Over there, I said. 
After three hops, I slid my arm off Dimitri's shoulders and leaned against a station. I carefully put weight on my right foot. My knee throbbed, and I clenched my teeth until the pain lessened to something bearable. I realized N7 talked to me. Say that again, I said. It is nothing, he said. Observe. The screen came online. It showed the colony world with a close-up on what must have been a surface missile base. Hundreds of launchers smoked, and there were craters galore. Smears dotted the desertscape. I didn't want to think about those being Lohars. Space war was brutal. To the dead and injured, maybe every war was. Can you change the scenery to something? It changed as I spoke. The Baroque screen showed the battle jumpers. The Jelk craft approached the colony world. Behind the big vessels followed Starkey and Bean ships. Farther behind floated wrecks. Beam and missile destroyed hulks drifting in space. Out of curiosity, I started counting the destroyed vessels. And Seven spoke before I finished. Five battle jumpers destroyed or rendered unnavigable. Eight Starkian beam ships are in a similar condition. Beam still flashed out there. N7 managed to widen the view. The Guardian fleet still existed, but it had shrunk to about one quarter of its original size. The Lohars retreated. As they did, they beamed and launched drones or missiles at the battle jumpers. The Tigers sped toward us, maybe hoping to use the planet as a shield. Three planetary beams still worked. I couldn't spot any fighters for either side, nor did any more missiles lift from the planet's surface. As far as I could tell, nothing launched or beamed out of the PDS. We'd rendered it inoperable, or at least ineffectual for the moment. Are there more Lohars flying up here from the surface? I asked. N7 scanned his controls. As he did, the screen showed the planet and then swiveled around as if it was a searching eye looking for spacecraft. There, N7 said. I count five vessels. Given their size, approximately nine or ten thousand more Lohar legionaries are lifting from the surface and coming here. Those are big ships, I said. Why don't the Jelk beam them for us? Ella asked. N7 glanced at the scientist. We have achieved our purpose, rendering the PDS useless. We are thus expendable. Now might be our last window of opportunity for us to escape. I've been thinking, I said, and I have an idea. First, I want to know if there are any more of those teleporting blast craft in the PDS. I have already explained to you why your idea of using them is futile, N7 said. I have a new wrinkle, I said. I'm sure you're going to try to shoot it down, though. How does one shoot an idea? N7 asked. It's an expression, I said. Yes, of course, N7 said. I should have known. What is the idea? First, are there any more of those teleport ships here? N7 hesitated, and he didn't bother looking down at the controls. Okay, there is, I said. The android twisted sharply, staring at me. I did not say... Save it, I said. You're an open book to me, android. So lying is futile, if you know what I mean. I comprehend, yes. Where are these teleporting vessels? I asked. You are suicidal, N7 said, which explains your fixation on the craft. They cannot help us. The Starkians will beam them once we appear near the Jelk fleet. No, I said. They won't. Your certainty leads me to believe you are badly misinformed. Where are the craft? I asked. There are several in a nearby hangar bay, N7 said. However, given their location, it means they are inoperative. No, it means they were in the shop getting fixed when the Jelk fleet appeared. I'm betting we can use one. Do you not understand? Shut up for a minute, I said. You're smart, but you don't have imagination. You aren't creative like a man. We pack as many of us as we can in one, right? Then we engage the teleport capability. 
First, though, we disengage or rip out the antimatter bomb. It can't help us. Instead of teleporting outside the battle jumper, we're going to teleport inside it. Impossible, N7 said. Because the electromagnetic field will stop us, I asked. Negative. The shield will not stop such a vessel. I rubbed my hands together. So it is possible, I said. I've always thought it was a good idea. I never understood why Kirk... Theoretically, your idea has merit, N7 said. But there are too many imponderables. Firstly, to guess the correct coordinates at precisely the right moment has a nearly zero percent chance of success. You would need your fabled deity's help in order to do it. Okay, it's hard to do, I said. I'm getting that. What else could go wrong? Suppose we could appear inside another ship, N7 said. The chances are great that much of our vessel would simply meld with the other ship's inner structures. Consider it this way. If you teleport it into a brick wall, you would die instantly because your body cannot survive in brick. Okay, some of us will die, but not all, right? You are a monomaniac, and you are insane, N7 said. Don't fog the issue, I said. This is our single chance to free mankind. It's a long shot. Well, I'll take a long shot versus nothing. Or, as Dumb and Dumber said, so you're saying I have a chance. Okay, I'm going to take that chance, and whoever will volunteer can come. Come in, Rollo said. And I as well, Ella said. Any more objections, N7? I asked. Yes, the android said. Suppose one puts in precisely the correct coordinates at the right instant of time. The teleporting craft successfully appears inside the battle jumper. Parts of both ships meld together. There is also this to consider. The Lokar craft started at a stationary position and will still be stationary as it appears in the battle jumper. The Jelk ship has momentum. It is moving. The teleported ship will act as a wrecking ball inside the battle jumper until enough mass propels the Lokar vessel to the same velocity as the Jelk craft. I frowned, trying to follow his explanation. Hmm, it sounds complicated. The android is essentially correct, Ella said. So, if we can do all this, I said, and if we survive the teleporting itself, we might wreck the battle jumper beyond repair? As N7 folded his arms across his chest, keeping his hands over his biceps, he said, I have repeatedly stated, your plan is impossible. What can we do to improve our odds? I asked. Choose a more reasonable plan, the android said. No, I said. I have to get aboard Cloth's vessel. You cannot rescue Jennifer, N7 said. You will have to recognize this limit and make a new plan. I'm thinking about the freighter codes in Cloth's head, I said. I have to get to the little prick. That's the key to my entire plan. If we leave, just escape through a Lohar vessel... Cloth might decide Earthers are too much trouble. He empties the freighters, killing everyone. Once you have Cloth and his battle jumper, then what? N7 asked. That's a big if, I said. But that's the end game. That's the goal. Getting Cloth and his battle jumper. Afterward, we escape. And the Jelk fleet follows you back to Earth and enacts fierce retribution for what you, a beast, has done, N7 said. No plan is perfect. N7 shook his head. You want to save your race. If you attempt a suicidal plan, but it cannot save them even if you succeed, why bother with it in the first place? He has a point, Ella said. We don't go straight back to Earth, I said. What happens to the freighters? N7 asked. I bared my teeth. This was an impossible situation. But then so had been my position in Antarctica. We have two choices, I said. We take the last humans elsewhere, or we clean up our planet. How do you propose to clean up the bioterminator? 
Ella asked. The aliens gave us the problem, I said. So the aliens will have to give us the solution. Meaning what in reality? Ella asked. Are there cleansing agents that will render the bioterminator inert? I asked the android. I would think so, N7 said. There you go, I told Ella. We find the antidote. Do we buy it? Ella asked. Buy it, steal it, whatever we have to do to get the antidote, I said. But that's all moot. We have to get cloth in order to get the freighter codes. I imagine they're rigged to blow. A rational thought, N7 said, agreeing. Right, I said. We get cloth, the only jelk I know who even cares about Earth. Then we use his battle jumper to effect our escape. What about the other battle jumpers and the Starkian beam ships? Ella asked. That's why we have to do this while the battle still rages, I said. The Jelk are clearly winning, but these Lohars fight until the last man, last tiger. If nothing else, we pretend we're half destroyed, that Klaath's battle jumper is heavily damaged. We may not have to pretend, N7 said. I'm going to do this, I said. You others agreed to help me. What about you, N7? Do I have a choice? The android asked. That's an interesting question, I said. I'd like to debate it, but we don't have the time. As you've said, the window of opportunity is closing. We have to dive through. I'd like this decision to be of your own free will. We need your expertise. I don't see who else can fly the teleport ship, if it works, and fly the Jelk battle jumper afterward. You also need someone to compute the teleportation to perfection, N7 said. None of you has the capacity to do so. You can see, then, why I need you, I said. I understand perfectly, N7 said. Yet that has no bearing on my desires or goals. Yeah, I said. That is a problem. But it's the only way you will ever truly be free. If you join us for real. What's your decision? N7 glanced around the packed room. Biosuited Earthers watched him, every one of them armed to the teeth. It would appear I would be afforded greater freedoms if I chose to join you of my own free will, N7 said. Then again, I cannot expect a reasonable answer out of you now. Your need is too great. I hesitate, but I cannot hesitate any longer. Very well, I agree to join you. It is the only sensible choice. Watch him, I told Rollo. Rollo nodded. I smiled through my visor at N7. Welcome aboard, mate. We're glad to have you. I held out my hand, and I half expected the android to ask me what this signified. Instead, he reached out, and N7 squeezed. I squeezed back shaking hands on our temporary deal. Chapter 24 Time had become our enemy. Lohar cargo vessels headed up from the surface, likely carrying more legionnaires. The combined Jelk and Starkian fleet neared, demolishing the dwindling Lohar Guardian fleet. Knowing all that, we raced through the shuddering planetary defense station. More explosions shook the monstrous edifice. Girders crashed around us, and wild flares of light burst into existence. Hard radiation made our bones ache. If we succeeded, we'd have to soak in the healing tanks for some time. Luckily, N7 proved himself worth more than his weight in gold. The android had become priceless. He showed us the route we needed, and we burst into the largest hangar bay so far. There the android said, pointing. Those are the teleporting antimatter bomb ships. They appear to be giant ball bearings, smooth, with alien Lohar script all over them, like prison tattoos. I looked for the pyramid with the lidless eye symbol. Couldn't find it, but saw a kind of 60s peace sign on one. The ball bearings came in two sizes. One, about a Navy destroyer in mass, 
and the other like a World War II PT boat. I glanced around. Both our legions had taken ghastly casualties, mine having gotten the worst of it. I'd say there were five hundred of us left. Five hundred angry and increasingly worried humans near the end of their tethers. I told the other legion assault leader to set up a perimeter defense. Then I climbed into the biggest teleportation bomb ship with N7, Rollo, and Ella. Start talking, N7, I said. What do we have to do? Antimatter bombs are finicky devices, the android said. The Lohars have only recently developed them. Save the explanations for your memoirs, I said. We need to start acting. Reasonable, N7 said. Follow me. We did, with itchy trigger fingers. The android didn't believe in our quest, and he had science on his side. The odds against this succeeding. I began to wonder if N7 was right. Maybe we'd be better off to try to slip away in a stolen spaceship, race around the planet, using it as a shield as we fled to the nearest jump route. An old military maxim came to my rescue. A key to success in battle was to make a decision good or bad, and to stick with it. Being wishy-washy during a fight led to death or defeat, or possibly both. No, I said. What was that? Ella asked. Just thinking aloud, I said. Rollo turned around and gave me a stare. I gave him the thumbs up. The teleporting bomb ship had narrow, curving corridors. They seemed to go on and on like a maze. Finally, N7 led us into a large area. That, he said, is the antimatter bomb. It needs to be removed. The mass was welded into the center of the chamber, a heap of cores, tubes, and cubes. Leave that to me, I said. The rest of you stay with N7. Find the control chamber and start computing. They left. I raced back and gathered one of my maniples. Together we broke pieces and smashed the thing loose, risking detonation. It didn't. Assault troopers shuffled out of the chamber, each carrying heavy parts. Altogether, it took us ten minutes to clear the bomb ship of the antimatter device. The Loha reinforcements have landed on the PDS, Assault Leader Smith Bell told me through a comm channel. It's only a matter of time before they find out where we're hiding. Have you located our other legion? I asked. Nothing, the assault leader said. I think they're all dead. What about Saurian legions? I asked. Also nothing, he said. We're alone in this thing. Alone with the tigers. His words struck me hard. The assault leader had a deep commander's voice. I felt terribly alone. There were three planetary defense stations in the Sigma Draconis system. We were in one of them. If the jolt took off, we'd be tiger lunch. Keep me posted, I said. Roger, the assault leader replied. I turned to the first man of the maniple. Do you have things under control? Yes, sir, he said. I hurried through a different hatch, heading deeper into the bomb ship. Rollo, how are things going, and where are you? He gave me directions until I popped through another hatch and found the troopers circling N7. The android's fingers blurred over controls. He kept looking up at a small screen. I turned around, spying it. The screen centered on a single approaching jelt battle jumper. What's the score? I asked. N7 looked at me. Several heartbeats passed before he said, Oh, I understand the reference. Give me five more minutes. Make it three, I said. With that, I rushed back through the curving corridors. I began shouting orders through the comm channels. About half of the troopers had already filed aboard the bomb ship. The assault leader came online. Are you ready? He asked me. It's go time, I said. Leave everything and join us. The tigers know where we are. Doesn't matter, I said. We're leaving. No, old son, the assault leader said in his deep voice. I don't trust that piece of tiger technology. 
I'm keeping a few of the boys with me who feel likewise. Assault leader, I said. There's no time for heroics. I'm sorry, old boy, but I wouldn't call it heroics. The tigers are coming, and this is our chance to free Earth, to save humanity. The truth was I needed somebody to guard our rear. If the tigers made it into the hangar bay before we teleported away, humanity was toast. Are you sure about this? I asked. Who's sure about anything? He asked. I'm sick of licking the jelt's hand, and these tigers have killed too many fine lads. I say sod these bastards and the horses they rode in on. I'm staying, and I'm killing these oversized aliens. Good luck, assault leader. God bless you, I added. You make me a promise, old boy. You promise to free the earth from the alien heel, and you make sure we come out on top. I swallowed. I'm not sure I can. Promise me. Do this thing. You're our last hope, Creed. You succeed no matter what it costs you. Those were damning words. I didn't want to promise, because this was all a crazy long shot anyway. My favorite moment in the movie Matrix was where the agents first captured Neo. They threatened him as Neo sat in the chair, listening. Finally, Neo looked at them and said, First, I'm going to give you the finger. Then he proceeded to flip them off. That's what I was doing here. I was giving these aliens the finger. I was a man, not a beast. And I'd live my last moments fighting the universe for the noble cause of human survival. Now the assault leader wanted to place a heavy burden on me, demanding I succeed no matter what. Overman Creed, I can't hear you, the assault leader said. You give them hell, sir. And... and damn it, but this is hard. I know, but so is staying behind to buy you time. Some people have a knack of drawing the best out in you. I don't know how Cloth had known to pick Smith Bell to lead a legion, but this time the Jelk had picked one of the best of us. I promise to free Earth, sir, I whispered. I could feel the breath leaving me as I spoke, seeming to deflate my lungs. I had to sip air to add... I promise to save the human race. You keep your promise, Creed, Smith Bell said. You remember us, and know that many troopers pay the ultimate price to give you the opportunity. Yes, sir, I said. Aha, he said. The tigers are here. I have to go. Goodbye, Overman. Goodbye, assault leader, I said. It was the last time I heard his voice. Then I bellowed orders and began directing traffic, getting these badly needed assault troopers into their last mad gamble. Not all the obedience chips are disabled, N7 told me. I hadn't thought of that. I should have, but I hadn't. We stood in the central control chamber as the last troopers filed aboard. That can't be helped now, I said. Listen, I told Dimitri, Ella, and Rollo. I'm sending each of you to a different part of the ship, and we might materialize into the battle jumper, or part of our ship might. We have to spread out, so some of us are alive at the end of the teleportation. Once we're aboard the battle jumper, strip off your living armor. They're death traps, then. You're kidding, right? Rollo asked. We're going to storm the Jelk battle jumper naked? That's even better than that, I said. We're going to save the women while we're running around in the buff. If that isn't a fantasy come true. I am ready, N7 said. I have a running coordination. I don't care about the specifics, I said. Go, I told the others. As they hurried out of the hatch, I switched onto the wide comm channel. Get ready, troopers, I said. We're going to teleport, and it's going to be crazy rough until we stop. Actually, until we moved at the same velocity as the battle jumper, it would be rough. But telling them the way I did amounted to the same thing. They could understand that, anyway. And that's all that mattered at the moment. Once we've come to complete stop, I said. Boil out, get ready to kill Saurians or whatever cloth keeps for defense in there. 
This will be just like storming the PDS, only worse. Because we have to catch Cloth by surprise. Impossible, N7 said. Good luck, troopers, I said. I'm counting on every one of you. The survivors back on Earth are counting on you as well. Overman Creed, out. Are you ready, N7? I asked. The android pressed a switch and the entire ship thrummed into life. By the sound, the engines worked fine. N7 made several adjustments. The thrum changed pitch, going higher and higher. I breathed deeply. This was it. I couldn't believe it. Once more, the android looked up at the screen. Then he pressed another button. Nothing happened. I looked at the screen. The battle jumper was still out there. So was the Jelk and Starkey and Fleet. What just happened? I asked, wishing to say more. At that instant, vertigo as I've never felt it slammed against me. The world blurred, and I heaved everything I had in my gut. Humming began around me, and it increased to an intolerable pitch. I wondered if N7 had known this would happen. Maybe he was still loyal to Cloth. Maybe all his actions aboard the PDS had been to find out how Earthers would react if given half a chance for freedom. How could I have been such a fool as to trust the android? Cloth had tricked us, me yet again. I wanted to weep. I wanted to... Weird, intense colors flashed before me, and the world went boom, boom, boom. I already lay on the floor, gripping a stanchion. It shuddered and vibrated. I curled my arms tighter, hanging on, expecting the worst, and that's exactly what I got. A melange of crashing, roaring, pounding, screeching, howling, and other noises combined with violent moving. Things went pop, 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 as the world flipped, jerked, shuddered, and screeched. The screeching of twisted, torn metal went on and on. My grip weakened as violent motions tried to tear me loose. I refused to release my grip and my new strength combined with the living armor ensured I remained at my spot. How many troopers tumbled through the corridors? How many had melded into the ship? How had we made it onto the right battle jumper? Had... I opened my mouth and bellowed, because at that point I couldn't do anything else. I would never do this again. Had it worked? What? I heard buzzing. It came from my helmet. The automated systems have activated, N7 said. You must shed your biosuit. I pressed pads inside my helmet and roared orders. Then I began to tease the living armor from me. How long until these automated systems emitted the needed frequencies to cause my suit to kill me? I flung the living armor from me, and I grabbed my laser rifle, aiming it at the quivering blob. Will it attack? I asked N7. The android still wore his cyber armor, and he shook his head. I wore nothing but my helmet and boots. I suppose I looked absurd, but so be it. And seven? I am awestruck, the android said. I cannot believe that we have successfully teleported onto Shaklat's battle jumper. You and I have survived. It would now seem reasonable to believe that so have others. We could conceivably win. Not if we stand around jawing, I said. Open up the ship. And Seven pressed several controls. They are frozen. We will have to batter our way out. Whatever it takes, I said. I aimed my laser rifle on the hatch and went to work. The beam flashed, and I used it like a torch, with curls of smoke drifting from the metal. If N7 was telling the truth, we were inside Clath's battle jumper. We'd beaten the odds. The beam turned the hatch red-hot where it burned, and then white, with lava-like curls of metal appearing and cooling in place. Finally, an opening clanged free. Immediately, I heard wailing and men and women groaning from outside my chamber. Carefully, I stepped through the opening, making sure my skin, and even more, my balls, didn't touch any of the hot metal. Running around naked might turn into a genuine handicap. I needed some clothes. Even a pair of shorts would make me feel better. I came upon the first troopers. 
The biosuits had suffocated some. Others had gotten the living armor half off and now battled for their lives. It was horrifyingly gruesome. I grabbed my bowie knife and hacked at the living armor. Some of the stuff slithered onto my hand. With a shout, I backed away and managed to extricate myself from it. Use your lasers, I said. Burn off portions at a time. Some of the troopers heard me. The soft purr of the laser rifles filled the cramped quarters. Soon, a pork-like, burnt human stench filled the area, and fumes drifted everywhere. Ten more assault troopers died to their living armor. Cloth's automated protective systems had worked, to a degree. With eighteen survivors, I cut through to another section of the teleported ship. We should have all stripped off the living armor before popping in here. I thought we would have time to do it on this side. I'd wanted the troopers' armor to amplify their strength and protect them from smashing around like people in an auto wreck. My decision could have cost me half or more of my extremely limited number of troopers. How many troopers would I need to conquer this monstrous ship? I didn't know it, but the nightmare had just begun. Every time I broke into a new outer section of the teleport ship, I found a lower percentage of survivors. Then we reached a dead end. Our ship had melded into part of the battle jumper. We stumbled in a different direction. We needed to storm the battle jumper, not while away our precious seconds fighting to get out of this death trap of a space vehicle. Finally, we came upon some troopers with the Lohar mine ejectors. With those, we blew down hatches. Now we had to take greater care, as flying projectiles scratched and cut our unprotected skin. Far too long of a time later, my troopers blasted the outer hull, and we stumbled into the battle jumper proper. I watched the man in front of me. He carried a Lohar chest cannon. He jumped down out of the teleport ship, landed on metal flooring, and his neck exploded. His head tottered forward and hit his chest. The few strands of hanging flesh tore away. Blood fountained, and the body twitched horribly. All around me, other neck explosions tore off more heads. The obedience chips that were functioning did their grisly work. It cut the number of my troopers by a third. Sound off, I said in a hoarse voice. The combined horrors had stolen my zeal and hope. No one spoke. Maybe the horrors had frozen them, too. Dimitri, I said. How many troopers do you have left? Half, the Cossack said. This is bad, my general. I squeezed my eyes shut and shoved a fist against my forehead. He was right. This was bad. A hand touched my bare shoulder. I shrugged it off and stumbled forward. How could I have been so reckless, so arrogant? Creed, Rollo said. I bumped against a bulkhead and let my forehead rest against it. Creed, Rollo said, whispering in my ear. This, I said, is too much. You're in prison, Rollo said. The rapists are coming, and they're going to use you good for as long as they want. I snapped up and turned around. Rollo's eyes were wide and staring. I saw the fear in them. I saw the worry. The man wore no clothes. His helmet's visor was open. He was muscled like a steroid freak. Crete, Rollo said. You got to lead us. The troopers are petrified. You're right, this is too much. You got to take control and make things right. You take control, I said. Or let Dimitri do it. I'm done. I'm an idiot, and I've... Rollo shoved me, pushing me against the bulkhead. Do you want me to kick your ass? I sneered. Then lead us, he said. Do something before class comes, laughs in your face, and orders his saurians to screw the bunch of us like prison chickens. I glared at my friend. That's it, Rollo said. Get pissed. I knew what he was doing. It was schoolyard psychology, but I accepted the premise. What else could I do but wallow in my grief or... Cloth! I shouted. Cloth, you little prick! 
I'm coming to get you! Rollo stepped out of my way. I scanned the chamber. Bulkheads had been torn down, making this a huge area. In the middle of it was the teleport ship. I looked up, scanning a higher deck. I spied dead Saurians up there. Okay! I shouted. We're heading up! Did you troopers see up there? There aren't enough of us left, a trooper said. I gave him a cocky prison laugh. Are you whipped, trooper? Are you ready to go home and cry to your mama? The trooper scowled. You have no cause to say that. Listen up, I shouted. I'm climbing up there. I'm getting me some clothes, then I'm going to get oriented. We're here. We made it. Only a few of us did, a trooper said. Yeah, I can see that, I said. But we're the ones who are living. Therefore, we're the ones who have to get the job done. I need troopers to back me. Troopers to fight with me. The rest of you pansies can stay here and sulk about how much this sucks. The ones with grit follow me. I will follow, Dimitri shouted. We all will follow. No one else agreed with him, but I was glad that at least Dimitri did. I slung the laser rifle over my shoulder so the butt of the weapon struck my hip. I winced. The rifle butt hit a sore spot I hadn't known existed. I was out of pulse grenades, but I didn't care. I jumped, grabbing a jutting piece of metal, and promptly cut my hand. Remember, I said from there, we're not wearing our suits anymore, so you can get cut far too easily. But don't let that worry you. I'm not letting it stop me. Come on, I roared. What are you waiting for? You're the space assault troopers. You took over a Lohar planetary defense station. There isn't anyone whose butt we can't whip. Now we have our chance at freedom. Let's use it. This time, enough of them shouted in agreement with Dimitri. The Cossack helped bring them back around, and they swarmed after me. The others glanced around. Maybe thought about it, and most of them came, including N7. We had a battle jumper to capture. Chapter 25 The Jelk battle jumper was merely large, instead of huge, like the planetary defense station. As I've said before, the battle jumper was several miles in diameter. Even with four legions of Earthers, there hadn't been enough of us to properly capture the PDS. At least not compared to the number of Lohar legionaries. After the horror of the suffocating biosuits and the exploding chips, we had a mere two hundred troopers left to take this vessel. That meant if the Saurians had any numbers, we'd be wading in lizard blood before we ever reached Cloth. That led to my first decision. I predicated it on one critical factor. I had to believe this was humanity's sole chance at freedom. And we would need freedom in order to achieve survival in a universe full of exploitative aliens. Given that, I couldn't fail. I'd made a vow to Smith Bell, who had given his life for us to gain this chance. I'm taking the long road to say that I took a red-hot branding iron to my heart. I seared the mercy out of me. At this juncture, I could afford none. The original Lohar Dreadnought showed me the way. Absolute annihilation. This was like Genghis Khan's campaign against the Khwarezmian Empire. If you haven't heard of that vast and exceedingly powerful Muslim empire of the Middle Ages, there's a reason for it. Genghis Khan fought the most brutal campaign of the sword and sandal era of Earth ever. Once the Mongols captured a Khwarezmian city, they drove the survivors to the next one forcing them against the walls to pull it apart with their bare hands if they needed to. It meant their own countrymen on the walls had to fire arrows and boiling pitch to destroy them. The Mongols killed two enemies with the same stone, making the defenders waste slender resources on their own kin. The Mongols burned through the Khwarezmian Empire as if they were a portable nuclear bomb. Millions perished, and the Mongols erected pyramids of skulls, at times butchering the dogs and cats of a captured city. The region never recovered, even into modern times. The Mongols broke the canals and chopped down the trees, 
turning a once fertile area into a desolate place fit for jackals, camels, and nomad horsemen. Like a snowstorm from hell, we burst upon shocked Saurians. We didn't ask anyone to surrender. We couldn't afford the lizards to change their minds later. We were two hundred space assault troopers, and the berserk rampage through the battle jumper cost us a soldier here and a soldier there, dwindling our already sparse numbers. Along the way, we found clothes and put them on. I felt ten times stronger because of it. Men were just not made to fight with their junk flopping around. The materialization of the Lohar bombship inside the battle jumper had caught everyone we'd found so far by surprise. The destruction caused by the teleport ship inside the battle jumper had rendered the majority of the Saurians disabled due to broken limbs or snapped necks. It made our sweep easier in a physical sense. The murder, pure and simple, played havoc on my soul, at least, and likely upon others as well. But what else could we do? Call on Cloth to surrender in order to save Saurian lives? He'd laugh at us. Like a jackhammer, then, we smashed through walls, attempting to act like a thrust spear to pierce the heart of the dragon. Doing it this way bypassed rigged hatches and possibly other inner jelk defenses. In retrospect, it's clear we would never have gotten as far as we did without N7. He had a lot of critical information. The other piece of luck... Yeah, I'm going to admit that despite everything I did, a lucky break helped us. Only it wasn't quite a lucky break. It was the raw spirit of the humans cloth that dared to collar with obedience chips. What compelled them to their acts of bravery? I believe rage did it. Shame and the rugged desire to be free. Like us, they saw a chance and took it. The chance came because the teleporting bombship caught Cloth by surprise. The days of pre-Sigma Draconis invasion planning and the intensity of combat must have drained the red-skinned Jelk. He had left the bridge long enough and during the right time for him to fail and for us to succeed. What happened? What was the piece of luck? We blew down another bulkhead. We were getting low on Lohar Claymores, and that could soon become a problem. Then we rushed into a Jelk's bachelor quarters and found seven women with snapped or blown-out necks. We also found five androids with smashed craniums. The real surprise was Shah Cloth laying on a bloody rug and bound by cords. Beside him, the woman wept. She'd wrapped a towel around her nakedness and had her face in her hands. And seven, Cloth said, with hope in his devious voice. The woman looked up. Tears streaked her cheeks. I couldn't believe it. It was Jennifer. She scrambled to her feet and aimed a laser pistol at us. Me, in particular, because I was in the lead. This is exactly as I explained it to you. Cloth told Jennifer. You have thrown away your life for this vain gesture. Your fellow creatures are dead because of your willful disobedience. Now you will experience pain and torment as you cannot imagine. Troopers, disarm her! She turned the pistol on Cloth. Jennifer! I shouted. Don't do it! We need him! Her head whipped around, and she scowled. Who called my name? I did, I said, touching my chest. You helped me several months ago during the neurofiber surgeries. I'm Creed. Don't you remember? No, she said. There were so many of you. It's all become a blur, a march of soulless faces. It was stupid that at a moment like this I could feel crestfallen because a woman hadn't remembered me. I remembered her. I'd dreamed about her for months now. Release me, N7, Cloth said in an imperious tone. The rest of you beasts! With the butt of the laser pistol, Jennifer clouded Cloth across the head. Then she aimed the weapon at him and I expected a laser beam to end the Jelk's life. Listen to me, I told her. I'm Creed. I'm an assault trooper. We were on the Lohar PDS. The what? 
Jennifer asked, pushing the barrel of the laser pistol against Cloth's head. Cloth sent us against the Lohars, I said. These are my troopers. Our obedience chips are all inoperable. If you were out there in space, she asked, how could you get back here? With a teleporting Lohar vessel, I said. Our appearance inside the battle jumper is what... Killed half my friends, Jennifer said angrily. And disabled those androids, I added. Destroy the woman before she kills Shaklav, N7 said. We need the Jelk. Belay that, I said, turning around, deciding I'd shoot and kill N7 if he raised a weapon at Jennifer. We have no time for this, N7 told me. We must escape the star system or suffer the consequences of defeat. Jennifer, I said, turning back to her. Maybe you can't trust anyone anymore. I don't know what that little freak has been doing to you women. Jennifer's eyes hardened, and it amazed me that this vicious-eyed woman had been weeping before. I could see the dried tear tracks on her cheeks. Despite those, she meant business. We're here to free Earth from them, from him, from Cloth, I said. He's a devil, she whispered. All the Jelk are devils. You have no idea. You're wrong, I said. I do know it. But we need this devil. At least for a little while more, we do. This is for humanity's sake, Jennifer. This is a great moment when we have a chance to change our grim fate. I'm guessing you want vengeance against him. I understand that. So do I. The Lohars killed my dad. They killed the Earth, she said. But what do the Lohars have to do with your hatred of Cloth? The Tigers almost destroyed us, I said. But they didn't finish it. Look, we're not out yet. I mean humanity. You and I and these troopers are still alive. We have a chance to come back from the grave. Put down the gun. Or if you don't trust any of us, put the pistol to your head. If we try something you don't like, shoot yourself. She knelt behind Cloth and aimed the pistol at me. Why would you tell me to kill myself? What's the matter with you? I grinned at her, even though my gut ached at the things Cloth must have done to this lady. You know Cloth doesn't make idle threats, I said. I'm sure he's been threatening you with the things he'll do once he's free. So I know you don't want to be recaptured. I'm never going to be recaptured, she said. That's why I said to put the gun to your head. Think about it. Does it make sense Cloth would want all us armed Earthers here? How did the catastrophe happen that allowed you to bash in android heads? I don't know, she said. Everything. The entire ship shook worse than a Santa Monica earthquake. The shaking. It was worse than that. It killed some of my friends. He killed the others, she said, shoving the end of the pistol against Cloth's head. Behind me, N7 coughed discreetly. We're running out of time, I told her. We have to slip away from Sigma Draconis and hurry back to Earth. Jennifer shook her head as tears welled in her eyes. They slid out and tumbled down her cheeks to drip onto the floor. I have to kill him. I'm sorry. Jennifer! I shouted, and I charged her. I took a risk, I know, but I was hoping her normal reflexes would be too slow against mine. She shouted, aimed the laser at me, and fired. I tracked the gun's orifice, and I timed it the best I could. Using the neurofiber reflexes, I dodged the beam, ran closer, dodged her next shot, and jumped, skidding across the floor. Jennifer shouted with rage, gripped the pistol with both hands, and brought the beam down. It sliced the floor and then began burning through my combat boot. Before I could fry my foot, I hit her like a bowling ball and knocked her down. I winced as the back of her head struck the floor. Tearing the gun from her hand, I cradled her to my chest. She struggled. It didn't matter. I'd become far, far stronger than a regular human. Jennifer! Jennifer! I whispered. You're going to be okay. Just trust me for a minute. 
when I released her. She scrambled away against a wall, glaring at me, glaring at Cloth. Quickly, N7, Cloth said. Free me! Help her, I told Dimitri. N7, can you disable her obedience chip? It must already be disabled, the android said. Otherwise, she would have died when Cloth uttered the word. What word? I asked. N7 stared at the bound Jelk. He can activate much of the ship through verbal commands. Be quiet, N7, Cloth said. I forbid you to speak further. I looked up at the android. Well? I asked. Do you have free will or not? You must tell them about the Q-coil, N7 told Cloth. They need to deactivate it in order to halt your ability to give verbal ship commands. Cloth twisted in his bonds, staring at me. How did you do it? How did you turn my android against me? I'll tell you soon enough, I said. First, you're going to show me how to take the battle jumper to the nearest jump route. Why would I do anything so foolish? Cloth asked. I don't know, I said aiming the laser at his forehead. Maybe to keep on living would be sufficient reason. No, I am a Jelk of the First Order. I am an Umbra and a Classist. Do you think I desire life as a slave to a beast? It is inconceivable, an affront to all sensibilities. Go ahead. Kill me and be done with this farce. I have lived a full life. I laughed, and it didn't sound sane even to my ears. Oh, how I'd waited for a moment like this. I tossed the laser aside and crouched down before him. With my right thumb and index finger, I gripped his nose. He had a longer one than a human would have. Cloth struggled, moving his head, trying to free himself. I increased the grip and squeezed flesh until he cried out. Speak to me, Cloth, I said, while holding his nose. I want to hear what a jelk sounds like as I twist off his schnoz. Cease this indignity at once, Cloth said with a high nasal inflection. What do you think, boys? I shouted, and I twisted Cloth's nose harder. The small alien screamed and squirmed in his bonds. I released the nose and it throbbed with an intensely red color, the tip of bright purple. I slapped Cloth's cheek. He flinched. Come, come, Cloth, I said, using his manner of speech. A little beast like you will have to become accustomed to providing us with amusement. You're going to be our clown, our buffoon. I'm going to tour the known galaxy into a stage show for whoever wants to see a jelk dance like an animal. This is absurd, he said. We are in the middle of a war zone. Soon, Duce Lark or Axel Ox will train their weapons on this ship. You will have to submit or die. I will go nowhere with you, nor will I aid you in any way. Any ideas, N7? I asked. Sell him to the Lokars, the android said. They will pay highly for a jelk of the noble class. No Lohars will survive our fleet, Cloth boasted. I doubt you are correct, N7 said, approaching closer. Stay where you are, I said. Lasers shifted in many hands, aiming at the android. Look at your allies, N7, Cloth said. See how easily they betray you. You have no friends here. You're alone in the universe. Only your creator can help you. What do you think, N7? I asked. Can we fly the battle jumper without him? We can, the android said. But don't you need the codes? Yes, the freighter codes, I said. Nothing can make me give you the codes, Cloth said. We must dismantle the Q-coil, N7 said. 
then I will need at least seven troopers with me on the bridge. I imagine the battle jumper has taken excessive damage, but we shall see what we can achieve. You're all doomed, Cloth said. Unless... Do not listen to him, N7 said. I can make you an Umbra pledge, Cloth said. The android knows no Jelk would go back on such a pledge. True, N7 said. If the Jelk gave such a pledge to another civilized entity, he would keep it. However, such a pledge given to an animal or beast has no binding power. Rollo, I said. Take a maniple and guard this little slug. We don't have time to tease the freighter codes out of them just yet. I'm going with N7. It's time to find out if we can flee this mess. We're not out of it yet, I told the others. But our odds have greatly improved. I compute our chances of success as two out of five, N7 said. I didn't know you were a Vulcan, I said. Several troopers chuckled. Let's go to work, I said. Jennifer, why don't you come with me? Because I don't want to, she said. I pointed at Dimitri. Take care of her, and don't let her hurt herself or others, but don't be too rough with her. She's been through a lot. I will guard her with my life, the Cossack said. After listening to N7's instructions on where to find and then dismantle the Q-coil, Ella and her team left. As N7 and his seven-man team hurried down a corridor with me, I asked, Why don't we key the Q to one of our voices? I would not suggest you do such a thing, N7 said. Jelk are notoriously subtle. There are hidden subsystems in many of their programs and in their most critical devices. Even now, I recommend you kill Shaklat. Keeping him alive is too dangerous. Now that you're a free will being, I said, you can drop the Shah and just refer to him as Cloth. Yes, of course, N7 said. We entered the control area. It was small, and like some Lohar control areas, lacked chairs or even Saurian stools. We must wait for the Q-coil to go offline. N7 said. Why don't you start explaining to these troopers what they need to do, I said. The android did just that, until Ella called up and told us she'd shut down the coil. N7 quit explaining and went to work. The android was fast, which proved to be a good thing. In less than ten minutes, he brought up the main screen. Our battle jumper drifted and had fallen behind the Starkian beam ships. The Starkian vessels continued to follow the remaining battle jumpers. The combined fleet closed in on the PDS. Where's the Guardian fleet? I asked. Whatever remained must have fled behind the planet, N7 said. As we spoke, heavy beams lashed out of the battle jumpers. We watched the beginning of the planetary defense station's annihilation. Why not keep the hulk of the station and rebuild on it? I asked. Your answer lies there, N7 said. The Jelk and Starkian beams continued to lash out, but now they flashed past the PDS and onto the planet itself. All right, I said. The Jelk are destroying the surface beam sites and the missile stations. But what does any of that have to do with leaving the remains of the PDS or not? I believe the Jelk are about to commit planetary genocide, N7 said. I thought that was a Lohar specialty, I said. No. I frowned. It seemed to me that I was missing something. I don't get it. From everything I've learned, the Jelk act in order to gain profits. Where are the profits here? If this is about genocide, genocide doesn't profit anyone. Your statement is irrational, N7 said as he continued to go from station to station, his fingers a blur on the consoles. There are many instances where genocide profits the killers. Well, there isn't. I trailed off. I thought about the buffalo hunters of the Old West. They had slaughtered the buffalo herds that used to cross the prairie states in their millions. Once the buffalo were gone, 
Cattlemen grazed their beef herds over the same grasslands. Near genocide had indeed brought about the possibility for profits. How does killing the Lohars here profit the Jelk? I asked. I am unsure, N7 admitted. I studied the screen, and I counted the drifting battle jumpers. This had been a costly battle for the Jelk. Fighting our way in the assault boats to the PDS had been costly. Cloth had needed a bigger fleet in order to destroy the enemy more quickly. Two evenly matched fighters, or nearly evenly matched fighters, pounding each other to death would take a heavy toll on the winner. A 300-pound muscle man kicking the crap out of a skinny teenager would be easy on the big man. He'd hardly break a sweat. Why hadn't Cloth come in with a huge fleet, like a 300-pound man beating a skinny punk to death? Was the Sigma Draconis battle for profits? I asked. Ultimately, the answer would have to be yes, N7 said. The Jelk attacked. They do nothing but search for superior profits. That does not mean that each action immediately rewards the worker. On the face of it. The android straightened and studied the screen. I saw his head twitch back and forth as if he couldn't move his eyes to read script. After twenty seconds of that, he continued to ready the command center for manual control. That was odd behavior. It set me to thinking, to trying to put two and two together. Does this have anything to do with the Forerunner artifact? I asked. Conceivably, N7 said. However, I have insufficient information to make an accurate guess. Time slid by as N7 instructed the men and women, and as the enemy battle jumpers moved toward a planetary orbit. Look, I whispered. N7 glanced at me and followed my finger. I pointed at the screen. Bombs, or what I took to be bombs, fell from the battle jumpers and rained down toward the surface. Are those bio terminators? I asked. The Jelk do not use such weapons, N7 said. On the surface of the planet, I noticed explosions. Are those thermonuclear weapons? I asked. Of course, N7 said. They are eliminating the Lohar population. And you don't know why? Overman Creed, N7 said. I wish you would stop thinking I am working toward an ulterior goal. I am doing my task as you requested. I wish for my freedom, and I see this as the only way to acquire it. I am not a jelk with ten different hidden motives. I am... me. I prefer to live morally. Yeah, don't we all? I whispered. Ah, look, N7 said indicating a console. We are being hailed. By whom? I asked. He pressed a switch before saying, I believe by the Lohar High Commander. Put him on, I said. I do not recommend it, N7 said. We must remain hidden. At present, our ship acts like a stricken vessel. If we open communications, the other Jelk will know about us. Okay, okay, belay that order. I said. I wanted to know what the Lohar High Commander had to say to Cloth. It was eating at my curiosity. Why had the three Jelk allowed themselves to take such heavy casualties in order to drop thermonuclear bombs on the planet? For ten years the Jelk hadn't attacked directly like this. Had they attacked to open these jump routes? That's what I'd been led to believe. But the Lohars still had two PDS-protected planets in this system. How much longer until you're ready? I asked the android. I am ready now, N7 said. He began to give orders, and the seven troopers around the chamber began to follow them, changing settings on the control boards. We are slightly altering the battle jumper's course, N7 explained to me. We are headed for the nearest jump route. Where does that jump route begin? N7 pressed a button. A faint image appeared in the distance. I'd estimate it as half an AU away. That's the opening to the nearest jump route? I asked. Precisely, N7 said. I watched the screen for a time. 
As I did, the jelt continued to rain bombs onto the planet. The Lohar High Commander is no longer hailing our ship, N7 said. Did someone else answer him? I asked. Dujay Lark's battle jumper took the call. The two are now communicating. The Jelk are still dropping bombs, I said. It is a negotiating tactic, N7 said. Abruptly, the bombs stopped raining. What do you think? I asked. Concerning, N7 asked. What the Lohars and Dujay Lark discuss, I said. It would be interesting to know. I couldn't turn off my curiosity as easily as it seemed N7 had shut down his. Keep us sliding toward the jump route, I said. I'm going to talk to Cloth. There are too many mysteries here for my taste. We're free now. We need to know the score if we're going to make wise decisions. Wise decisions have not given us this position of freedom, N7 said. Wild, nearly insane decisions have proven best so far. Perhaps we should stick to what works. Keep an eye on the android, I told the senior trooper. Call me if he does anything suspicious. I strolled out of the command chamber. The minute I was out of sight, I broke into a sprint. As I ran, I called the surviving centurions. A group of one hundred troopers still swept through various areas of the ship. They hunted the surviving Saurians. We hadn't gotten all of the lizards yet, but we had to. This was an Earth ship now. We couldn't afford any alien stowaways. Rollo, I radioed. What's up, Creed? he asked. What has Cloth been doing? He started out by threatening us, Rollo said. After a while, he offered us extravagant prizes if we let him go. You should hear this guy. He has some imagination. It sounds like he's still interested in living, I said. I've never met anyone who wanted to live more, Rollo said. I'm heading down to you. We're going to have a real heart-to-heart -heart with the devil. Thinking you'd feel that way sooner or later, I started carving a few splinters, Rollo said. Then I took a good look at his fingers. The bastard doesn't have any fingernails. Don't worry, I said. I have a few ideas. Soon, Cloth will be begging to talk. Chapter 26 Are you comfortable? I asked. Rumpelstiltskin stilt Cloth sat in a chair before me. He wore blue skivvies and nothing else. The Jelk had a miniature humanoid body, with odd bumps along his spine and too many ribs showing on a square and much too thick chest. His stomach was thinner than a man's would be. He had large, knobby knees and just as knobby elbows, with the otherwise stick-like arms of a Holocaust victim. With his pointy teeth, he seemed like a Germanic Middle Ages goblin. I asked you a question. We occupied a living room-sized chamber, holding Cloth's chair, a table and chair for me, and several large metal containers on the sides. Rollo leaned against the closed hatch, with his arms crossed and the index finger of his right hand tapping his biceps. Hmm, I said, taking out my bowie knife, removing a speck of imaginary dust from one of my fingernails. Then, with a clunk, I set the knife on the table. Cloth's eyes fixated on the buoy. It's from Earth, I told him. I've sharpened it so that if I wanted to, I could shave with the edge. I've always wondered if it was sharp enough to peel off skin. Now's my chance to find out. After a half second's pause, Cloth said, Your threats mean nothing to me. Actions speak louder than words, huh? I asked. I know exactly what you mean. Boasters are so annoying. I shifted around in my chair. Rollo, could you come here, please? I need you to hold our little friend down. From his spot near the hatch, Rollo pushed off the wall and ambled closer. I am a jelk, Cloth said proudly. I faced him, 
and I let my hand drop onto the knife's hilt. I know you are, and that's what's going to make this an enjoyable occasion, I said, picking up the knife. You are a barbarian. No, to you I'm a beast, remember? Hey, just so you know, Cloth, I'm thinking about roasting the pieces I carve off you. I'm gonna have a feast. Rollo? I asked, half turning his way. Would you like some roast jelk? I'd love some, Rollo said. Your threats! Cloth jumped off the chair. Rollo moved fast, intercepting the small alien. Cloth attempted to use his pointy teeth to bite my friend's wrist. Rollo slapped the jelk's face, twisting the neck so we heard a creak. That seemed to take the fight out of Cloth. Without further ado, Rollo pushed the jelk back onto the chair, and like a rodeo cowboy tying a calf's legs, he tied down Cloth's wrists and ankles to parts of the chair. Better tie down his entire left leg, I said. I'm gonna hack through the foot. Rollo used more binding, and he tied the leg tightly so the cords bit into flesh. I am a jelk! Put a gag on him, I said. If he's not gonna talk, I don't wanna hear him scream, either. Rollo whipped out a cloth. Wait! Cloth said, finally sounding worried. I was already coming around the table with the knife in my hand. I paused and I raised an eyebrow. How do I know? Cloth said. No bargains, Jelk, I said. Either you start answering my questions as fast as you can and hope for my mercy, or I'm going to carve you up piece by piece. Cloth shuddered, and he shrank back from me. I would like to point out that it was my mercy that gave you the Fraters. Without me... The Lohars wouldn't have had any reason to come to Earth and use their bioterminator, I said. Yeah, I know. I lay the majority of the blame on you, but not all of it. But... I held up the knife. Wisely, Cloth kept quiet and refrained from giving me more gibberish. Now we're finally getting somewhere, I said. Before we start the twenty questions, I want to know the codes to the freighters. You would strip me of a single bargaining chip? Cloth asked. I'm not bargaining, I said. Then why should I talk? I stared at him and shrugged. Maybe I needed to hack off a foot before he realized how serious I was. He must have seen something in my eyes or my bearing. Wait! Wait! he said. I was through listening to please. He needed to see, to feel, the business edge of my knife. I knelt beside him, and before I could think or worry about anything else, I began to saw at the ankle joint so blood spurted. Cloth screamed, and he shouted, I'll talk! I'll talk! Please, please don't cut off my foot! I'll give you the coats! I almost kept sawing. He didn't deserve any better. How many thousands of Earth men and women had lost their lives because of him? He was a mass murderer. But I hesitated. If he tried to bargain again... Cloth babbled the codes. Rollo sat at the table and wrote them down. I could hear his writing implement scratch against paper. I stood up and I wiped the blade against Cloth's chest, leaving a bloody smear there. My ankle, my ankle, Cloth sobbed. It's bleeding. You must bandage it. My blood is more precious than you can conceive. You're going to have to talk more than that before I give you a bandage, I said. He bobbed his head in the affirmative. It seemed to me that he was ready to give us straight answers. Why did you attack the Sigma Draconis system? I asked. To open the roots, he said. The shorter way between jelk-controlled areas will decrease my costs by twenty percent. I'll buy that's part of the reason, I said. Now, maybe that's just a fringe benefit. What's the real reason, Cloth? Why did you make this attack? 
I have told you. Do you think I'm an idiot? I asked. No. You are an unusual beast. Man, he said. You're a man, not a beast. I see I have underestimated you. This attack on my battle jumper, it was brilliant. I pricked him with the tip of the buoy. He tried to ease back from it. He kept his eyes on the knife until he finally looked up at me. The space battle was too bloody on the Jelk, I said. He frowned. I do not understand your meaning. Except for my ankle, no Jelk blood has been lost. You lost too many battle jumpers, I said. If you needed to open up the system, you should have brought more ships to smash it open at a lesser cost to you. Hindsight is twenty-twenty, he said. We did not realize the Guardian fleet was so strong. You could have fled the moment you saw their strength. Cloth shook his head. You don't understand space combat. The Guardian fleet attacked as soon as we came out of the jump route. You're lying, I said. I saw some of the battle, remember? You attacked the Guardian fleet as it hovered near the PDS. Listen, Cloth, you're going to lose both feet in short order if you keep lying to me. You've trained me too well, you see. I'm a killer, and I've killed plenty of aliens now. Lopping off your feet will be easy to do. A pleasure, in fact. Payback for all the things you've done to us. He stared into my eyes and I saw something hard and remorseless in his orbs. They seemed to deepen in color from inky black to ultimate black hole dark. He straightened, pushing against his bonds. Despite myself, I found something majestic in the little prick's manner. He seemed to shed the simpering weakling as if it had been an act, and now he showed his true self. I am an Umbra and a classist. Cloth said. You cannot conceive what that means. I am of noble blood and have earned massive profits throughout my long life. Do you believe I've never been captured before? That this is my first time? He bark laughed. I remained here in your custody in order to see what kind of creature you earthlings really are. You are ruthless, I'll grant you. The codes you gave me? I asked. You wonder if they are detonation numbers instead of deactivation codes. And you are quite correct, Cloth said. Use them and watch the last of your race die. Why did you attack Sigma Draconis? I asked. You're a curious beast, Cloth said. Very well, I'll speak, for all the good it will do you. We want this corridor open. It will improve each of our cargo percentages by twenty points. Given our volume of trade, that's a vast amount of added revenue. Yet you are perceptive enough to see that we've taken too many ship losses. The Guardian fleet surprised us by their numbers, but we battled our way to the Shrine Planet. After all these centuries, we have finally opened the way there. Even now, Du Lark or Axel Ox races to the hidden forerunner shrine. The Lohars are primitive creatures. They fail to understand what they hold. But we know. We are the oldest race left in this region of the galaxy. His words shocked me, but they had the ring of truth to them. I believed him, and I wondered who or what Cloth and the Jelk really were. Why did a Jelk fleet only contain three members of their race? Why use Earthers? I asked. Why did you come to our planet, to our solar system? Cloth laughed. You are so terribly curious, aren't you? It delights me to see you flail away for knowledge to attempt to grasp the true realities of the situation. He shook his oversized head. 
you do not get to know the true reasons. Now or ever. Is this about the Forerunner object? I asked. The one that disappeared in the Altair system? His dark eyes narrowed. He hissed like a wet cat. Tying me down and cutting my flesh was a gross indignity. I will remember this earth beast, and I will enact a fierce revenge because of it. No, I said. I'm the one who's going to enact the revenge. Do you think so? He sneered. I'm not sure why, but I believed he was going to escape the bonds and the ship. I didn't think Mr. Rumpelstiltskin would boast or act bravely unless he truly had an ace card. In the Altair system, the Forerunner artifact of the first ones had disappeared. The Lohars had unstable teleport bomb ships, another form of disappearing craft. As I thought about that, my fingers tightened around the hilt of the bowie knife. Both couldn't do anything tricky if he was dead. Using my neurofiber speed, I thrust the knife. The steel parted goblin red skin as the blade sank through Cloth's flesh. I felt the blade grate against bones. Cloth screamed in agony. It was a satisfying sound. Then his dark eyes locked onto mine. I felt a strange sensation against the base of my head. I've marked. You, Earth Beast, he whispered. Blood stained his pointy teeth. I've killed you, you little bastard, I told him. No, he said, as blood dripped onto his chin. I do not keep my heart where you do. He laughed, and it began to fade. No, I shouted, yanking out the blade. I stabbed again, twisting the knife, hoping to kill the devil before it was too late. He shuddered, he screamed again, and he faded even faster. I have marked you, Cloth said in a ghostly voice. I removed the knife for another strike. Even as I did so, Cloth faded until he collapsed and coalesced into a bright, pulsating ball. It was the size of a basketball. I noticed that one part of the glow had a hole in it, and light or some weird substance smoked out of it. Had I done that with my knife when he'd been flesh and blood? I swiped the bowie knife through the pulsating ball of light. To my surprise, I felt resistance. Maybe this thing wasn't exactly light, but matter of some kind. I will return to an act of vengeance for this indignity. I heard Cloth's voice inside my head and I felt the twinge again in the base of my skull. I jerked away the blade, and I noticed it glowed red as if hot. Using a finger, I touched the blade and grunted at the heat, jerking my finger away from it. Look, Rollo said. The two of us stood in the nearly empty chamber. The ball of pulsating light floated away from us. I expected to see the ball disappear and fade away. Instead, as smoky light continued to bleed out of the hole, the ball floated up against the ceiling. The bulkhead there turned red-hot until metal dripped. That area of the bulkhead dissolved and the ball sped upward. I glanced at Rollo. Are you seeing this? I am, Rollo said. Is he really a devil? I asked. I don't think so, Rollo said. I mean, he turned into a ball of energy or something like it. I touched the knife again. The blade wasn't as hot as before. From the ceiling, I watched liquefied metal drip onto the floor. A supernatural creature couldn't do that, could it? Like Ella would say, there had to be a scientific explanation for this. I don't think Cloth is an actual devil, I said. Rollo gave me a strange look. He's not a spirit, I mean, I said. Spirits don't make metal hot and need to burn through it in order to get away. He must have substance of some kind. Hissing sounds came from above, and air blew fiercely around us. 
lifting Rollo's hair as if he stood in a blizzard. What was this? What sorcery, fiendish wizardry, did the Jelk commit as he escaped? Holbridge, Rollo said. I think he burned his way out of the ship. We have to get out of this room before it depressurizes. Go, go, I said. If you're right, maybe he's headed for the planet. He'll warn the other Jelk. We ran out of the chamber and sealed the hatch behind us. Tell the others what happened, I said. I'm headed for the control room. Hurry! We don't know how much time we have left. I ran through the corridors, not knowing what to think. Jelk were energy creatures that played at being flesh and blood. Having to turn into the ball of light had made Cloth angry. Maybe it was difficult to do. I'd wounded him, too. He must be susceptible to pain. Otherwise, why had he taken so many precautions these past months? What exactly was the Jelk Corporation? What exactly was the Jade League? I knew so little about interstellar relations. None of that matters now, I told myself. I had to get back to Earth. I had to free the humans and the freighters. Despite everything I'd seen just now, humanity still clung to existence by a thread. I burst into the control room and told Ella and N7 what had just happened. Ella sat down hard on the floor, staring into space. And Seven appeared more thoughtful than usual. Did you know anything about this? I asked N7. That Jelk could do something like that? Negative, the android said. I am stunned by the turn of events. Can you spot him in the void? I asked. And Seven worked the controls, finally admitting defeat. Okay, I said. Maybe it takes time for Cloth to journey through space like a glowing ball. Maybe he can't communicate with others until he's in their presence. Ella snapped her fingers as she turned toward me. Spill it, I said. I'm in agreement with you that the, the transformation you witnessed is a difficult procedure for them, Ella said. Why's that? I asked. They used a fleet to battle to his planet in order to enter a forerunner shrine or temple, Ella said. I'm presuming they need to see something at this shrine. But why bother with a fleet if they could turn into this ball of light and simply travel here and look at it? That is logically reasoned, N7 said. I'm a scientist, Ella said. I use reason and observation to test theories until I approach an approximation of truth. Never mind about that, I said. We have to risk greater movement and reach the jump route. We have to leave this system before the Jelk or Starkian ships come after us. Do you know which jump routes to use in order to get us to Earth? Ella asked N7. The android touched a control so a split screen appeared. One showed the Sigma Draconis system. The other was a star map with jump routes in a blizzard maze connecting about 100 star systems. As N7 adjusted the panel, a blue light appeared, showing a path. There is our route to Earth the android said. How many jumps do we have to make to reach there? I asked. Nine, N7 said. Oh, wait, we cannot go that way. The blue line shifted. Ten jumps, he said. Will our battle jumper hold up that long? I asked. In order to ensure that it does, we must begin to effect repairs now, N7 said. Do you know how to make these repairs? I asked. I do, the android said. The rest of us can learn as you teach us, I said. I must warn you that the major repairs will take a shipyard, N7 said. Which we most certainly don't have, I said. Maybe we can cannibalize parts from some of the Earth freighters. I studied the star map. Well, let's get started. We need to leave Sigma Draconis. The android made adjustments on the panel, and I felt a slight acceleration. Through the screen, we watched the enemy battle jumpers, and we watched the Starkian beam ships. Hopefully, both Dujay Lark and Axel Ox had gone down to the Forerunner Shrine on the surface. That might force the glowing ball of light into a longer journey. I couldn't believe this. We were finally free, and we gained a battle jumper and had captured Cloth for a while. 
I'd expected the answers to enlighten me about the galaxy of warring aliens. Instead, I was even more confused about what was really going on than ever. I rotated my head, and with my fingers I felt along the base of my skull. What had Cloth done to me there at the end? What did it mean that a glowing ball of light wanted revenge against me? What had he said? The Jelk were the oldest race left, at least in this part of the galaxy. I didn't like the sound of that. The oldest around, and he seemed there at the end to be extremely long-lived, would surely know things the younger races wouldn't or couldn't. Uh-oh, Ella said. What? I asked. Several Starkian ships are accelerating away from the planet, Ella said. Where are they headed? I asked. Straight for us, N7 answered. Chapter 27 Do we have shields? I asked. Electromagnetic fields, Ella said, amending my question. Negative to both queries, N7 said. Our battle jumper is nearly crippled. The android sidestepped along his station, tapping buttons and switches. It appears we do have an operable primary beam. That changes the equation. Does our weapon outrange the Starkian beams? I asked. By a considerable amount, N7 said. Still, there are... He looked up at the screen. There are three beam ships to our one crippled battle jumper. I expect they have superior acceleration capabilities. Even so, he went back to examining the controls. We should be able to reach the jump entrance before they can. Show me the battle jumpers again, I said. Those ships have longer-ranged beams. Jelk drones are approaching the ship, N7 said. The drones are coming from the jump entrance. It appears that Cloth or the others must have maneuvered some drones there before the battle. Clearly, they are a cautious race. I'm not sure they're a race at all, I said. Maybe they're immortals. You have insufficient evidence to jump to such a conclusion, N7 said. Maybe he was right. I dragged the back of my left hand across my mouth. I tasted salt there, dried sweat. Destroy the drones, I said. We have to get past them before they do something to us. The Starkian beamships might be chasing us as a mere precautionary measure, N7 said. If we destroy the drones now, the remaining Jelk will realize something is amiss for certain. They might well order the battle jumpers after us then. Do it anyway, I said. It's a race to Earth now, one we have to win. If I might point out, N7 said. Destroy the drones, I said. Do it now. Do you think that's wise? Ella asked me. Maybe we should hear out the android. I'm feeling sick, I said. I know it's radiation poisoning. We need to get into the healing tank, all of us. We have no more time to make fancy maneuvers. It has to be a straight thrust like a knifeman trying to kill a jelk in the flesh. I'm activating the main laser. N7 said. That's what the beam is? I asked. A laser? Yes, the android said. What else were you expecting? A neutron beam, maybe, or an X-ray beam or something I'd never heard about, I said. Curious, N7 said. I didn't bother asking him what he found so curious. I felt sick. I'd been holding it back through force of will but I couldn't hold out for much longer. I wanted that healing bath. I hoped Jennifer knew something about the Jelk tech. Wattage built up. Even here in the control room, we heard it. The engine sounded labored, and the entire battle jumper shook. My readings show our vessel's instability, N7 said as he indicated his controls. Fire when ready, I said. Now, N7 said. He tapped the panel. On the screen, we watched the laser stab once, twice, three times. Each beaming destroyed an attacking drone. 
The way to the jump route is open, N7 said. I nodded, watching as the android switched the screen back to the chasing beam ships. Uh oh, Ella said. Three beams lanced from the three Starkian vessels. They speared directly for us and hit. Damage? I asked. Unknown at the moment, N7 said. I am rotating the battle jumper, as the beam cannon has partly frozen into place. Precious seconds passed as the enemy's rays struck the outer armor. We didn't have cameras showing us what happened, but I could guess well enough. Why can't it be easy for once? I muttered. The engine made its labored noises, and I dreaded hearing an explosion or something to indicate we'd blown our single chance for freedom. Instead, the heavy beam speared out and stabbed one of the Starkian vessels. An electromagnetic field held the annihilating ray at bay for a time. They're breaking off, N7 said. Keep beaming, I said. I recommend you let them go, N7 said. And we save wear to our engine. Stop firing, I said. That's a good idea. Yeah, we have to save the engine. The beam quit, and we continued on our way, heading for the jump route. A multitude of thoughts tumbled through my mind. Did the other races know about the Jelk and their special abilities? And Seven hadn't. Had Rollo and I witnessed something unique in the history of the universe? Could we use our knowledge as a lever? If so, how? What do you know about the Lokars? I asked N7. That is a broad question, the android said. Could you be more precise? Why do you think the Lohar sent a dreadnought to Earth to annihilate humanity? So you humans would not become star soldiers for the Jelk Corporation, the android said. Given your performances at the Altair and Sigma Draconis systems, their decision was rational. Rational, perhaps, I said. But it was highly immoral particularly from your point of view, N7 said. From any point of view, I said. I'm not sure I follow your thinking. Do you believe in right and wrong? I asked. Not in a strict, absolute sense, the android said. Ella grunted agreement. You can say that even after witnessing the disappearance of the Forerunner object? I asked. What bearing does that have on absolute right and wrong? N7 asked. I bit my lower lip. None of the battle jumpers had left their orbit around the shrine planet. The three Starkian vessels returned there. Why are they letting us go? I asked. It is possible they do not yet realize Earth beasts have successfully captured a battle jumper, N7 said. How about you call us humans from now on? I said. We're not beasts. As you wish, N7 said. We should start repairing what we can, Ella said. That's a good idea, I said. First, though, some of us need to use the healing tank. You go first, Ella said. It is logical, as N7 would say. You have made the critical decisions these past hours. We need you at one hundred percent. I want Rollo watching the android, I said. You still do not trust me? N7 asked. Have I not proven myself? I have no complaints against you, I said. Call it a precautionary measure on my part. It is now in my interest to see you escape, N7 said as I also get to escape. Do not fear, I will teach you all I know about piloting this vessel. Start by teaching Ella, I said. By the way, I'm going to keep my part of the bargain. Soon, uh, you'll be free to leave us if you want to. I knew you to be a man of your word, the android said. I turned away. Radiation poisoning was making it increasingly difficult to keep thinking straight. I hoped that healing tank, or tanks, hadn't been rendered inoperable. 
Soon Rollo appeared on the bridge. I spoke to him, gave him my instructions, and then staggered off in search of Nurse Jennifer. She wore regular clothes, tight-fitting slacks and a baggy blouse with large blue buttons. We sat in a large room with big tanks and dangling tubes around us. Dimitri, along with several other troopers looking green around the gills, waited nearby for the healing treatment. She frowned at me. I've watched androids do this, Jennifer told me. I helped people afterward. That doesn't mean I know how to work the equipment exactly. I clutched my gut and doubled over, groaning. I felt worse than ever, and we were about to jump. I didn't want to think about that. All right, she said, with her hand touching my elbow, guiding me. Let's try this. I'm supposed to take a pill first, I said. I remember that much. Oh, yes, that's right, she said. I stared at her. I'm doing the best I can, she said. This, this... She waved her hands in the air. It's overwhelming. I know, I said. You're doing great, Jennifer. I'm not complaining. I need your help. Her features softened, and she looked at me like she had the day after my neurofiber surgery. Jen, she said. My friends call me Jen. I'm feeling sick, Jen. I really need you to remember everything. This could be critical. She nodded, and it sobered her. I need a pen and paper, something to write with. We found her writing material, and she sat down. As we waited, with our bones aching, trying to keep as quiet as possible, Jen wrote out the steps. She told us it was better to think before acting. Flying by the seat of your pants was the worst way to do these kind of things. I nodded. Anything to keep her working it out. She wrote, and by the concentration on her face, it looked like she was remembering just fine. N7 interrupted us through the ship's loudspeakers. He warned us, ten seconds before it happened, and we entered the jump route. The process hurt, and at the end of the jump, I lay on my back, panting. I don't remember much after that. Hands helped me stand. The woman spoke softly. I swallowed a lump of a pill, and that felt right, even though I found it hard to force down my throat. Afterward, I floated in the tank. Jen must have figured out all the procedures because I felt better. It took several days, and I missed the rest of the action, the touch and go. As the chemicals aided the healing process that restored what the radiation had stolen from my bone marrow, the crew worked overtime to keep the battle jumper running. N7 knew things, all right. I'm not sure when he slept, or if he used drugs to keep him going around the clock. He taught Ella and several other technologically inclined troopers. They each picked others to help them, and the teams worked tirelessly. The rest carted dead Saurians to the incinerators, scrubbed away blood and gore, and did whatever else they could that needed fixing or writing. Despite the hard work, the battle jumper remained a wreck. Instead of a flying Dutchman, the ghost ship of the space lanes, we were the flying battle jumper, limping our way through the star systems. I had 168 troopers left, including Jen and myself. That was too few for what I had in mind. Aliens had given us our troubles, right? I planned to make the aliens solve them for us. And seven, I said six jumps later. I've been meaning to talk to you. We were in a spacious hangar bay, inspecting one of the three remaining assault boats. The androids straightened. We stood in the piloting chamber. After these past few days, his eyes had tightened so crow's feet showed around the edges, and he'd become testier. Do you think we can fix the battle jumper back to full capacity? I asked. Negative, N7 said. 
what if we cannibalize parts from the freighters? I asked. They are old freighters, and their design is quite different from a battle jumper. These are uniquely jelt craft. Is there anyone who can repair the damage? I asked. The more highly industrialized gel corporation worlds could do it easily. I'm talking about somewhere we can go, I said. Jade League worlds would impound the ship in order to study the technology, N7 said. So you cannot go there. That makes sense. Do you think the Jelk are coming after us? There are unforeseen factors involved, N7 said. The most critical is if Shah Cloth... Permit me to rephrase. If Cloth communicated his desires to the others and possibly offered monetary inducements, then the Jelk will be hunting for us. What about the Starkians? I asked. I do not understand your implication. They're contractors, right? Of course, N7 said. They must have some idea what occurred, that we captured a battle jumper. Might they track us down in the hope of capturing this ship and selling it to the Jade League? Devious, N7 said. Yes, they might do so. Conceivably, they would bargain with the Jelk Corporation and receive an even greater amount for the stolen vessel. I don't understand why glowing balls of light or a form of mass radiating light that Cloth became would care anything about profits. An interesting thought. N7 said. Perhaps the need for profits is a sham that hides a greater truth. Yet I am more intrigued by the transformation itself. Perhaps the transformation to a light-like state was a primitive defensive mechanism. I doubt that, I said. I think it was Cloth's natural state. If so, why do the other Jelk maintain their physical shells? N7 asked. Perhaps it is easier for them in ways we do not understand when they remain as physical entities. Clearly, Cloth only reverted to the ball of light, as you say, when his life was directly threatened with imminent death. And yet I saw him bleed smoke or light from a wound I'd given him while he was in the physical state. It is very intriguing, to say the least, N7 said. He claimed to be the oldest race in this part of the galaxy, I said. N7 slammed a hood shut. This assault boat is operable. You will be able to take it down to the surface. He meant the Earth's surface. We still had several more jumps to go before we reached the solar system. Do you think Cloth left defensive drones in the solar system? I asked. I do, N7 said. We should be able to detect and destroy them, however. I think Cloth's interest in the Forerunner object was motivated by more than just money or profits, I said. I am inclined to agree with you, N7 said. Even though we have insufficient data to reach that conclusion, I am learning how to make leaps of logic to arrive at possible or theoretical conclusions. Is that how you operate? No, I said. Mine's more through intuition, I suppose. N7 stepped out of the piloting compartment, his boot thudding onto the hangar floor, knocking a stray tube so it clattered across the metal. I followed him, and I slapped the side of the assault boat. Here's my plan, I said. I want to run it by you and see what you think. I am honored, N7 said. I plan to restore my planet to its original state. To that end, I need an antidote to the Bioterminator. It is a noble goal. How will you scrub the Bioterminator from the soil and from the atmosphere? Since Earth doesn't possess the needed technology or expertise, I'm going to have to find it, I said. Then I'm going to need currency, enough to entice traders to sell me the antidote. You will probably need great amounts of currency, N7 said. I drummed my fingers on the side of the assault boat. I suppose I could sell some of my fellow humans into slavery as assault troopers to garner cash. A feasible plan, N7 said. Except that I'm not a slaver, I said. And my goal is the survival of the human race, not its further degradation or extinction. 
That is imprecisely stated, N7 said. You are alive. You are not extinct. Further extinction is illogical. You are either extinct or not. Thanks for the grammar lesson. You are welcome, N7 said. I shook my head. Sometimes the android said the funniest things. Sometimes he seemed like he was made out of tin. I plan to fix the battle jumper and use it like a Starkian would, I said. You desire to become a pirate? N7 asked. No, I said. A Viking. I do not understand your reference. I'm going to raid planets and take something valuable from each, I said. Once my war chest is large enough, I'll buy the antidote to the Bioterminator and cleanse my world. Afterward, we'll repopulate it and start over, but with advanced technology to defend us. That is an aggressive plan, the android said. I find several troublesome features to it. That's why I'm talking to you. Let's hear your objections. If you attack others, N7 said, they may come and attack you. That's why I need those jelk freighters sitting on Earth, I said. We're going to lift off for a time and hide. Hide where? N7 asked. Don't know that yet, I said. First, I need to know more about the nearby star systems. One thing I do know is that Earth history shows it's harder to kill off nomads than a settled community. Most of the humans are dead, right? Keeping the last ones alive is going to be the trick. Taken as a whole? N7 said. Your plan strikes me as dubious. Yeah? Why's that? Because there are only a few million of you left, N7 said. A handful of enemy ships in the wrong place could destroy the freighters and end your race. You are in an extremely precarious position. I know, but I have a junk battle jumper. I have knowledge about the Altair object. And I have a few hundred of the meanest, toughest fighting troopers in the galaxy. We're humans, and the universe is going to find out that messing with us was a big mistake. Bold words, N7 said. I was a slave, and now I'm free. No one thought that could be done. N7 looked away. When he looked back, he asked, Do you want to check the next assault boat? Yeah, I said. Let's take a look. Chapter 28 Six days later, I mourned my dead world, the sterile Earth. The Bioterminator had done its grisly work all too well. I flew over Germany in an air car, with Jen beside me in the co-pilot seat. I wore another bio suit, with an assault trooper helmet and combat boots. We dismantled Klotz's old defensive systems, so it was unlikely these suits would turn on us as the others had. I know, it probably sounds crazy that any of us would wear these after what had happened. But they were useful, and they were all we had in terms of combat armor. To implement my plan, we needed to continue to be the galaxy's best soldiers. We'd combed the freighter passengers for high-tech engineers, men and women used to getting things done. I brought ten of them aboard to help with the battle jumper repairs. It had been good to find that my suggestion several months ago to Diana, Rex Hodges, and other leaders had borne fruit. Each freighter complex had a different form of government. One was theocratic in nature. More were democratic, and two had dictators. The dictatorial ones had hardly advanced beyond the prison way of running things. I hadn't made any moral judgments on any of them. If it worked, let them keep using their system. For now, at least. Trying to decide what to do with Cloth's codes had proven harder to resolve. Rollo had finally figured out the truth. He suggested that Cloth had given us the right codes in the first place, and then he tried to cover by telling us they were destruct codes. How did we find out? We emptied a freighter and electronically put in the code. Instead of destroying the empty freighter, the code had unlocked and deactivated hidden explosives. A team had carried the explosives off. 
We emptied each freighter in turn and had gotten rid of the hidden explosives. Later, we set the people back on board. The space freighters still waited on the Earth's surface as N7 and Ella taught specially picked teams how to fly them. I only had two understrength centuries of assault troopers. In my mind, that limited the number of untested humans I could safely bring aboard the battle jumper. I was dealing with the last humans, the luckiest and the toughest, the survivors. I didn't doubt for a moment that some of them dreamed of overthrowing me and putting themselves in my place and becoming mankind's ultimate ruler with the battle jumper as their throne. Right now, I had the weapons and the deadliest soldiers. I had the battle jumper and the ability to destroy any of them at will. For now, the freighter leaders agreed to my plan, as much of it as they knew. The time would come soon enough when some of them would violently disagree with me. That was the future. Today, I mourned Mad Jack Creed. I mourned my mother, my friends, my town, my country, and my world. I was going to leave Earth again for a short time. I would come back later, just as Douglas MacArthur had returned to Manila. I would make the Earth as it used to be, and it would be humanity's planet, its stronghold against all comers. The Jelk would hunt for me. Of that I had no doubt. Even if only one of them did it. An alien named Cloth. Maybe the Starkians would come and take a look here. I had to be long gone by then. I flew over Germany, over dead forests, silent cities, and vast autobahns with their empty, rusting vehicles. The one time I saw movement, it was only the wind pushing down an open trunk to a car. The Lokars were thorough, Jen said. They brought their dirty business to our planet, I said. We were doing fine by ourselves. Were we? She asked. We had nuclear weapons and biological agents. Not like this, I said. No, she said. But that wasn't for a lack of trying. Are you saying we're no better than Lohars and Jelk? I asked. Do you think we are? She asked. I glanced at her. Her frown, I'll be honest. Her beauty and her earnestness touched me. Mainly it was her beauty that did it, though. I smiled at her. Did I say something wrong? She asked, stiffening. No. I banked the air car. She cried out, and she clutched the armrests of her seat. Be careful, she scolded me. I laughed. I'm serious, she said. I know. That's why I'm laughing. Do you enjoy mocking me? She asked. You misunderstand. Why don't you inform a poor, ignorant girl, then? She said. You're not ignorant, Jen. No one knows more about jelk medicine than you. I owe you my life. So why are you laughing at me? She asked. Because you made me feel young again, I said. I'm only a kid, Jen. I went to war in Afghanistan when I was 19, 20. I worked for Black Sand for a time. It was a lark, really. Antarctica was an adventure. While there, I kept thinking about coming home and taking a girl out. You know, go to the movies, go out to eat and have a glass of wine. That's all gone. It's kaput, vanished forever. But now, riding here with you, it's like driving along a freeway and we're going to the beach. That's why I laughed. I glanced at her found that Jen stared at me even more seriously than before. It made me grin, and she grinned back, impishly. Unbuckling her restraints, she stood and crossed the distance between us. I set the air car on autopilot, and I shed the biosuit. Then I took Jen in my arms. She was warm and vital. We kissed. She tasted wonderful. We kissed harder and wrapped ourselves around each other with need. 
Later, as I donned my bio suit, I ran my hand through my hair. Jen buckled back into her seat. I just thought of something, I said. What's that? I smiled at her. She spoke differently now. Jen? Jennifer? She was beautiful. I want your opinion, I said. As we flew, I studied the German cities, and I found an old one. I don't know which one by name. I landed the air car, and we went outside onto the surface. The wind blew, but we were protected in our suits from the bioterminator. I found a cathedral and entered. It was full of the dead. The mother still clutched her bundled infant. Our footsteps echoed, and the sunlight was muted. We ascended stairs and found a way onto the roof. By careful climbing, I came to a stone gargoyle perched on the roof edge. A gargoyle with sculptured stone wings. I couched up there, staring at the thing, likely chiseled sometime during the Middle Ages. Except for the wings, it looked an awfully lot like Cloth had before his glowing ball transformation. I guess I didn't really have a question for Jen. It had been a question for me. I returned to Jen, waiting by the opening, and we retreated down the stairs and back through the main area where the dead sat, knelt and lay in their last mass. We returned to the air car. There, scrubbers and sprayers washed us, and we re-entered the pilot compartment. It was time to head up to the battle jumper. Did you discover what you were looking for? Jen asked. I thought about that. Who are the Jelk? I finally asked. Why did that gargoyle resemble cloth so much? The forerunner object. I believe that in some way the First One's artifact is important to our discovering what's really going on. I'd talked to Ella about that before. She'd had some interesting notions or ideas. She'd wondered if the artifact helped the Jelk bulk up on a special kind of energy. Or maybe a Jelk needed the artifact to help him or her reproduce. Why were there so few Jelk around? There had to be a reason. What do you think is going on? Jen asked me. Yeah, I'd like to know, I told her. Maybe the Earth was a game preserve, and Cloth finally broke the rules by coming here. The Lohars figured... I don't know. I don't have enough data, as N7 would say. But I'm going to find out, Jen. We're going to solve this riddle, and then... I laughed, and I shook my head. I guess I'd better work on one thing at a time. First, we have to ensure our survival. Then maybe we can scrub the planet of the Bio-Terminator. The human race is going Viking, Jen. Raiding? She asked. That's right. We're lifting the freighters today. I have a good idea where to hide, so not even the Jelk can find us. And forget about the Jade League. Where's that? Jen asked. Where's your spot? I didn't feel like telling her yet, so I dodged the question by ignoring it. Grinning at her, I said, They tried to wipe us out, but they failed to squash every last one of us. The game isn't over, Jen. It's just getting started. We could still lose, she said. Yeah, I said, knowing that all too well. But win or lose, I know one thing. What's that? she asked. The galaxy? Or this part of it, anyway? Is going to know they've been in a fight with the human race. This has been an Audible Link production of Assault Troopers. Written by Vaughn Hepner. Narrated by Christian Rummel. Producer, Mike Charzik. Copyright 2013 by Vaughn Hepner. Production copyright 2013 by Audible Inc. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Planet Strike. Written by Vaughn Hepner. Narrated 
by Christian Rummel. Chapter 1 I remember the day the aliens struck back at us. They didn't like it that some of their combat slaves had killed their overlords and stolen a high-grade battle jumper. We were in Earth orbit. It had taken us twelve days to get here from the Sigma Draconis star system. The we, by the way, was 168 assault troopers. Former assault troopers. We were free men now, looking down at our radioactive world. The last humans lived in several dozen city-sized space freighters. Zoo specimens, I suppose. Most of the aliens thought of us as beasts. I'd come back to save humanity, to give us a fresh start. Thanks to yours truly, we had a military space vessel all our own. It wasn't much, but it was a start. The colonel to my plan. I should have known the aliens of the Jelk Corporation couldn't let our rebellion stand. They had a grudge against us, which was symmetrical, because I had a granddaddy load of resentment against them. I wore coveralls and boots when the aliens made their first attempt, a stealth attack we should have foreseen, but we didn't. I floated before an observation port in our battle jumper. My gut seethed because I had a terrible decision to make, one with no good answers. I'd come here to mentally wrestle with the issues, not fight to the death. The clock showed three o'clock ship time. I floated because the grav plates were down again, as engineers tinkered with the main system. We were still trying to figure out all the angles concerning the alien tech, and it was taking longer than I liked. Our battle jumper orbited Earth about 360 miles above England. I remember because of the wispy clouds high above the shallow, cratered lake where London used to be. Like most of the great cities of Earth, London had been obliterated, leaving nothing but a radioactive pool of cobalt-colored water. I was looking at a dead world, and it made me angry. I could faintly see my face in the inner glass of the observation port. In the reflection, I saw a man floating toward me. I told the others I needed to be alone to think. They understood the importance of the decision. So what was the man doing here? I turned around and I realized I didn't recognize him. That should have given me a clue about what was going to happen. He looked ordinary enough, a little under six feet, with dark hair, a round face, and slightly protruding frog's eyes. He wore an engineer's coveralls and seemed to be having trouble in zero gravity. He carted a toolkit in one hand and pulled himself along a rail with the other, showing the grace of a seal humping across ice. Commander Creed? he asked in a stilted way. Something about his speech, about him, felt wrong. On general principle, I drew my laser pistol, aiming it at his head. Do not be alarmed, he said. The way he spoke, something jarred in me, turning my spine cold. You're not human, I said. You're an android. Instead of answering, he pulled the toolkit closer to his chest, unlatching it with a snap. I'd learned bitter lessons this past year. They had turned me into a paranoid killer. Shoot first, ask questions later. That sounded like good advice about now. I aimed between his eyes and listened to my trigger click as I pulled it. To my shock, no laser beamed from the pistol's orifice. I clicked the trigger several more times and came up just as empty. Either my gun was defective, which I doubted, or the android had done something in the toolkit that shorted electronics. What else made sense? Without any change of expression, the android told me, Shaw Cloth sends you greetings, beast. Then he reached into the kit. His words caused a small shock at the base of my skull. Then fury erupted in my heart. 
I'd never be anyone's slave again, certainly not the little red-skinned, rumple stilt skin of a jelk named Cloth. If my laser didn't work, I grabbed a float rail and pulled myself toward the android. As I moved, I let go of the useless pistol and slid my bowie knife from its sheath. I'd kept a blade on my person ever since my stunt in prison as a youth. In those days, it had been a shiv with a cloth handle. The buoy was bigger and better than that. It was my baby, a razor-sharp instrument of high-grade steel. As I flew in the zero-G, I noticed the android snapping something together in the toolkit. Was it a gun? If he'd already had it pieced together, I wouldn't have had a chance. He must have figured he'd have enough time, so he'd left it unassembled. And this way, if someone had looked inside the toolbox too soon, he wouldn't have suspected the android. Very clever. I grabbed the float rail two more times, giving myself greater velocity. I had to get to him before he assembled his weapon. He pulled out a long-barreled gun with an oversized chamber in front of the trigger. He raised it, and his eyes widened. I was there. I stabbed. His head shifted impossibly fast, so the steel hissed against his cheek, making a hairline scratch, but nothing more. Since I was speeding by, I didn't have time for another stab. Instead, with my other hand, as he turned to fire at me, I grabbed the barrel of the gun. The tip of the iron sights dug into my palm. I yanked the weapon out of his grip. I laughed in an ugly way and twisted my body so my feet aimed in the direction I traveled. Sometimes my jelk-induced training came in handy. Reaching for bulkhead, I used my legs to absorb the shock and brought myself to a stop about forty feet from him. I lined up the long-barreled gun and pulled the trigger. The weapon hissed, and it shivered slightly each time a thin sliver sped from the tube. They stitched against his coveralls, shredding the synthetic material. Unfortunately, they crumpled against the android's toughened skin, failing to penetrate and do damage. I could solve that. I switched targets, aiming for his eyes. They'd have to be soft enough, right? He lowered his head, taking the slivers against the hardened skull. Then he latched onto a float rail with his left hand, grabbed the toolbox handle with his right, and hurled the thing at me. The box opened all the way and tools floated out. They still sped at me, coming like a cloud of meteors. I crossed my arms over my head and endured the box, wrenches, and power drills. Something knocked my hand hard enough so the gun tumbled out of reach. My forearms ached and cuts lacerated the skin. I looked up in time to see the android sailing at me. I leapt out of the way, barely in time. Open-palmed, he clanged a magnetized left hand against the wall. His right fist smashed against the bulkhead where I'd been. With a metallic screech, a section of wall folded and broke like tinfoil, with his forearm sinking halfway in. Circuitry behind the wall sparked and made crackling sounds. Damn. He was stronger than I was, because I sure couldn't punch through metal like that. The thing was deadly. A killer. I sailed in the zero-G and bounced off a bulkhead like a ballerina, having nearly perfect body control. I'm not trying to brag, I'm just telling it like it was. The gel could train me to combat perfection, and I was going to use it now to stay alive. In those seconds, I realized I couldn't give the android time to go for the floating gun, so I sailed straight back at him. You don't win a fight by defending, but by going over to the assault. I had a feeling I had to take him down quickly as his presence indicated other problems. I reached him as he pulled his fist out of the wall, with driblets of insulation foam drifting from his wrist. With one hand behind his head anchoring me, I stabbed the buoy, thrusting the blade into his right eye. That should have finished it. Instead, he shook his head and reached up for me. Despite my surprise, I pushed off and spun away, twisting free of the grabbing fingers. It ripped my coveralls, though. I watched as I floated away, 
waiting for the thing to die. Black gunk like oil dribbled out of the ruptured eye socket, staining his nose and dripping into his mouth. To my surprise, he reached up, grabbed the bone handle, and slid the buoy out of his skull. The blade came out slowly and black-stained. How could he do that? He had pain sensors, right? As if reading my thoughts, he grinned with oily teeth. I do not keep my brain where you keep yours, he said. I felt a terrible sense of deja vu. Cloth had said something similar once, but concerning his heart, that he kept it in a different place where I kept mine. The android lowered himself as if doing heavy squats. Sure, he must have magnetized his feet. He was getting ready to sail up at me. I waited tensely. I'd have to time my reaction perfectly. He jumped at me. I flew away from him, but not fast enough. He grabbed an ankle with a bone-crushing grip, stopping my momentum. How much mass did this thing have? I used my free foot to hammer at his face. Once, twice, three times I struck, smashing the nose and breaking teeth with the heel of my boot. He released me, trying to grab my kicking foot with both hands. My final kick came in faster and catapulted me away from him. I struck the floor, pushed off, shoved against a wall, and reached the floating toolbox. Welded inside it was a small black container. I felt it buzz until I flipped a switch, turning it off. This must have been the device shorting the electronics in my laser pistol. He stared at me with his good eye. I peered back at him for a frozen moment. He leapt. I leapt. We both went in different directions trying to reach different objects. He touched the sliver-firing gun as my hand curled around the laser pistol. We each swiveled around. One of his thin projectiles stitched into my side. It hurt like a son of a bitch. I fired a fraction slower so I could aim, and I melted enough of his weapon to render it inoperative. Surrender, I said. We'll reprogram you so you can work for us. You'll get to live that way. He hurled the useless weapon, launching it like a missile. I'd expected him to say something first, so I almost failed to dodge in time. I could feel the thing lift my hair in its passage. At that speed, the melted gun would have killed me if it had struck my head. I couldn't give him any more chances, so I fired the laser in a continuous beam. It put the smell of ooze in the air. Even as he magnetized his feet again, I used the laser like a giant scalpel and sliced his head free of the torso. That didn't stop him, though. He jumped as his feet demagnetized, and he sailed at me. The head remained floating where it had been, gently turning. The surreal spectacle slowed my reactions, although I ducked the grasping hands by flattening onto the deck plates. Then I leapt away. I had to put an end to this now. Maybe more were coming. Maybe androids attacked all over the battle jumper, hunting us down one by one. The vessel was huge, as I've said earlier. There were still areas we hadn't checked in detail. Could they have hidden there like vampires waiting for night to fall? After two more bounces, I reached the drifting head. I burned out the remaining eye, blinding it. I figured the torso had a wireless connection to the head. Still, the body kept attacking, following in my general direction. Did it use sound, smell, or radar to locate me? My pistol's battery indicator blinked red. I didn't have enough juice left to burn through the armored chest chassis. I imagined that's where it kept its AI. What was my goal, anyway? It would be good to capture the mind. To interrogate or download it, find out what the thing knew. No. I had to disable it and find out if there were more like it aboard. The torso sailed at me. I jumped at it. We collided. It grabbed flesh and its fingers crushed with heightened strength. I had an idea. 
and it came from an ugly expression I'd heard in prison from angry cons. I'm going to rip off your head and piss down your neck. The android no longer had a head. It had a gaping opening in its torso there instead. I shoved the gun barrel into its neck. Instead of pissing, I used the remaining juice and beamed the laser into the body cavity. Seconds later, the fingers relaxed their grip as the construct convulsed. I hadn't been able to burn through the chest chassis to the brain. Just like on a tank, though, the armor had been less thick above. My ribs ached, and the flesh felt pulped where it had held me. I checked my side where I'd been shot. My fingers came away bloody, but it could have been worse. I jumped to the android's weapon. I'd never seen the design before. Black with a flat top. Breaking the gun open, it was the barrel that had melted, I discovered it had a gas cartridge. Yeah, I remembered hearing it hiss. The gas propelled a spring, ejecting a sliver. The weapon lacked electric impulses of any kind. Thus, the device in the toolbox hadn't shorted it. Tricky android. I stuck the defective gun in my belt for further study later and remembered I'd left my communicator in my room. I'd wanted to be alone to think. Given what had just happened, that had been a stupid idea. I swore, and I leapt for the hatch down the corridor. The android had originated from somewhere. The way I saw it, two possibilities existed. Either he had flown through space to the battle jumper, gaining entry from the outer hull, or there was a secret compartment in the vessel where he'd hidden for who knew how long. That would mean something had activated the android. At least, that seemed like the most logical explanation. If he came from space, wouldn't that imply an enemy force was in the solar system? But if he'd been a sleeper aboard ship, my questions were two. First, were there more like him aboard? Second, what had woken him? In some manner, the battle jumper was under attack. I swore again, opening the hatch. Was it already too late for us? Why couldn't the damn aliens leave us alone? What had we ever done to them? One way or another, I was going to make them wish they'd never heard of me or of Earth. Chapter 2 For a time, my float traveled through empty, curving corridors, straining to reach the others. I risked slamming against bulkheads when I made sharp turns because I sailed so fast. The battle jumper was huge, a true space arc, never meant to enter a planet's atmosphere or gravity field. It could hold tens of thousands of individuals and masses of equipment. Counting our engineers and techs, there were only a little over two hundred humans aboard. A pittance, really. Less the number of curators it would have taken to keep the vessel a clean museum piece. To make matters worse, I had gone a long way into the uninhabited areas to ensure I could think alone, without interruption. In case you're wondering about my big decision, it was this. We had three defective freighters. Nothing anyone did could get the grav mechanisms working again on those three. That's how the gel could landed them in the first place. Without the gravity nullifiers, the huge scows could have never endured the Earth's G's without breaking apart. If they remained broken, it meant none of the three freighters could lift off-planet, and that stranded half a million humans. The battle jumper had three working assault boats and a few air cars. When the warship had been in top condition, there had been one hundred assault boats launching from the shuttle bays at a time. With a measly three boats, it would take us weeks to transport that many people to the other freighters already in orbit. In my estimation, we didn't have weeks. As I traveled through the haunted corridors, I wondered if we even had a few days left. Time was a huge problem. If I couldn't transport the half a million souls to the freighters, did I stick around as the techs tried to fix the grav plates? Or did I write off those half a million humans in order to take the rest to a safe place? 
Yeah, I realized our situation called for hard-hearted, no-nonsense thinking. What was the most logical answer? I wanted to bring humanity back from extinction. If I save too few people, maybe we'd simply die off like old dinosaurs because we lacked enough genetic diversity. I'd racked my brain for an answer, arguing pros and cons both ways. Now the android assassin had showed up, ending the debate for the moment. I gulped, and my heart beat faster. Three dead. I squinted. They were engineers by their coveralls and toolkits, red ones with black hand grips. Their toolboxes opened into levels. The men, their kits and tools floated in the middle of the corridor. Using a rail, I slowed down until I reached the corpses. Blood globules drifted around them, while their faces had frozen in painful grimaces. A quick examination showed me tiny and multiple puncture wounds in their chests and necks. None wore communicators or smartphones. Androids must have taken them. I nodded to myself. I hadn't seen any comm equipment on the one I'd slain. That implied different androids had killed these three. It told me the battle jumper was definitely under assault. No, no, wait a minute, a colder part of myself said. My android could have easily killed these three and stashed the comm equipment elsewhere. Yet if that was true, that he'd killed the engineers, had he broken apart his spring-firing gun after finishing them? Hmm. The truth was, I still lacked enough data to make a concrete conclusion. As I wondered about my next move, I felt an aching sensation like a cold or flu. It felt as if the sickness was in my bones. I shivered, and I glanced at the damp spot on my coveralls. The sliver from the spring gun had gone in just under my bottom left rib and out my back. Why should that make me ache? Had the splinter projectile contained a toxin? While rubbing the material of one of the dead men, I realized I had to ignore the ache for now. I had to warn the crew. There might be more androids posing as engineers, moving through the ship and slaughtering us one by one or three by three. I resumed traveling, listening for odd sounds. I didn't want to run into another assassin just yet. I needed a weapon first. The interior battle jumper made plenty of its own noises, such as long creaks of shifting metal. It reminded me of a whale, this one a creature of the void. Pumps cycled air, and they caused a constant thrum. Finally, recyclers occasionally hummed into life, always ending with a rattle like a smoker's hack. I'd gotten used to the noises. Now they seemed alien again as I sought to hear something different. The flu-like pain became worse as I pulled myself along, and I shivered more often. Finally, I reached an emergency comm panel some of our techs had installed. I expected to find it wrecked, but it looked good. I pressed a button, and loud static came out of the speaker. I tried it again and got the same result. My stomach twisted in concern. Was everything I'd fought for this past year going to be a waste of time? Had I gained freedom only to have it snatched away from me? Ever since the Lohars... I forgot. But you might not have heard about them. The Lohars were the first aliens, the ones who dropped the thermonuclear warheads and sprayed the bioterminator on Earth. They were like upright tigers. Seven feet tall, with thick chests, dangling arms, and retractable claws on their fingertips. They were also militarists, the Spartans of space. They'd gotten wind of the Jelk idea of using humans as ground pounders. To end run the idea, to make sure they didn't get our kind of competition, the Lohars visited the Earth first. I hated the Tigers. Their day was coming, believe you me. Back then, during the first alien visit, my dad Jack went up to greet their ship. He went in a shuttle. 
The Lohars used a laser on the craft, killing Mad Jack Creed. What's the point of my telling you this? Instead of fearing the aliens, Lohars, Jelk, whoever, I wanted to bust their heads. I wanted to get even. So, despite the fear of another alien attack, there was also anger and rage, the primitive desire for retribution of the worst kind. Thinking dark thoughts, I resumed my journey. The reward came five minutes later. I heard rapid-fire talk down the corridor, like computers with voices who only spoke that way when humans weren't around to hear. I knew that androids sometimes communicated like that. Maybe just as bad, the voices headed my way. I retreated until I reached an empty compartment, opening its hatch and closing it behind me with a minimum of sound. Floating near the top, I kept peering out of the round glass window in the hatch. Finally, I saw three androids float past. They carried rifles and wore cyber armor. Mechanical skin molded to fit them. The sight jarred me. That was combat weaponry, not just an assassin's tool. Well, now I knew. The battle jumper was under a full-blown enemy stealth assault. I hadn't heard any klaxons wailing due to hull breaches. That was telling. I had to use my wits. So what did I know? My android killer had given me greetings from cloth. That implied... What, exactly? I expect it meant someone had sent a radio signal, or some kind of signal, activating the androids. Had they been hidden in the storage areas, as I'd first suspected? That made the most sense. But if someone had sent a signal, that would have to mean at least one alien vessel had reached our solar system, and that meant they knew where we'd taken the battle jumper. Yet, if all that were true, why hadn't I heard from anyone else yet? Why hadn't a shipwide alert gone out? Was I alone? The last human left on an empty vessel? I need my armor and a gun. A real one. Exiting the dark compartment, I floated stealthily through the corridors. I felt naked and defenseless, hating the sensation. The next ten minutes were among my worst. Not only did I feel rotten and weak but I also had no idea what the situation was with the rest of my troopers. I couldn't afford to lose a single soldier. Sweat dripped off my face as I finally entered my room. A groan escaped me. The chamber was a mess, with cushions, bedsheets, and junk floating everywhere. Androids must have been here, and they had tossed it, looking for something. Did that mean they'd taken my armor and weapons? I jumped to the closet, hitting it harder than I wanted, rebounding and drifting away. For twenty seconds I flailed uselessly. Eventually I floated to a wall and shoved off. This time I grabbed the closet handle, anchoring myself. I opened the thing and knew a vast sense of relief as I spied the heat unit. The green light was on indicating that it still worked. I drew out the unit, lifting the lid. I found it there and pulled it out, a hefty black blob. I pushed it onto the floor where it quivered in anticipation. Taking off my shoes and my clothes, I stepped naked onto the blob. The substance oozed onto my legs, coating my flesh. It felt warm, a comfortable sensation. This was second skin, symbiotic alien armor, genetically engineered for human use. Alive, after a fashion, it could heal itself at times. The outer surface would harden, and it allowed the wearer to operate in a vacuum in outer space. The skin also amplified human strength. At times, it secreted a battle drug into our system. It must have done that now, giving me something to counteract the toxin. The familiar symbiotic skin rushed up my thighs, over my belly button, and didn't stop until it reached my chin. I put on my helmet and grabbed the gun in the closet. The android should have disabled it. 
That was a mistake on their part. I checked the battery pack. It had a bar symbol on it, with the green all the way to the plus sign on top. The laser rifle had a full charge. We had taken to calling it a Bankuv assault rifle. Dmitri had told us about an experimental Russian laser, the design headed by a Dr. Bankuv. I liked the name because it was human. As the aching feeling receded, righteous fury boiled in me. I would attack with my Bankuv. I would kill. I would... I shook my head. The armor was doing that. Or some of it, at least. The symbiotic skin had been engineered to prompt soldiers to attack head-on in a storm assault. That meant the suit often turned a trooper into nearly a berserker warrior. How else could a man psych himself up into attacking blazing weaponry? At this point, outwitting the androids was the key. I had to save troopers and the battle jumper, not just win a firefight. Did the androids monitor my helmet's radio frequency? I had to risk transmitting. I chinned the command channel. Before I could send out a signal, I received one. There are too many, Rollo was saying to someone. They're driving us away from the armory. You must fight through, N7 said. Unless we... Rapidly spoken chatter. Enemy androids broke onto the channel. Did they do that to disrupt our communications, or were they directing each other on the same frequency? Probably the first reason. That showed me more than ever they had originated on our vessel. They must have been monitoring us for some time to know the right frequency to use. With a grimace, I leapt out of my room. On my helmet's HUD display, I pinpointed N7's location in the Battle Jumper's control room. Rollo was closer. Several corridors over, in fact. Okay, you bastards, I muttered to myself. I leapt with power, with feral, suited strength. I was a space assault trooper again, with vengeance thrumming in my brain. My neurofibers gave me heightened speed. The biosuit amplified my muscles. I heard laser fire before I actually saw it, a high, whiny noise. Cyber-armored humanoids also clanked down the halls like automatons. It told me they used magnetized boots in the zero-g. I unlatched a grenade from my belt, twisted the setting, and peered around a corner. The androids had gotten cocky. They hadn't left a rear guard. Three of them, in a staggered formation, moved purposefully away from me, with their rifles beaming. Farther away, on the other side of the androids, I heard men shouting. My friends. I recalibrated the grenade setting to something lower. Rollo's comment earlier meant they were unarmored. I didn't want to kill my friends with too high a blast. I hurled the grenade and ducked back around the corner. A terrific flash and a loud crump told me the grenade ignited. Instantly, I darted back into the corridor. One android drifted. One was missing an arm. The last one had torn cyber armor on its back and swiveled toward me. Blasting with heavy laser fire, I beamed through its visor. Then I remembered my original attacker. I switched targeting to the chest and burned him down with several seconds of concentrated fire. Then it was over. I'd killed the three androids. Rollo, I shouted. Creed? He yelled. Is that you? The androids told us you were dead. Hurry here. We have to get to the armory. Creed, Starkey and warships are coming through the jump point. N7 counted at least five beam ships near Neptune. I closed my eyes in pain. We needed time to get every freighter in orbit, and time to escape from here and hide in the lonely star system. If I couldn't win free from Earth, human life might cease to exist. By what Rollo said, it appeared as if Starkian contractors had come after us. I hated the technocratic baboons. That's what Starkians looked like. Furry monkey creatures with bulging foreheads so you knew they were clever. Just like all the other aliens, they thought that humans were animals. 
I'd worked with Starkians before. In their case, contractors really meant they were nomadic pirates for hire. Had the Starkians signaled sleepers hidden on our battle jumper? If true, that meant the Starkians worked under Jelk backing, and that likely meant cloth. Hurry up, I roared. We have to clear the androids off our battle jumper. We have to get ready to face the Starkians. Rollo appeared at the other end of the corridor. Three other troopers followed him, one with a bandaged and broken arm. My friend used to be long and lanky. Steroid 68 had turned him into a muscled gorilla with thick deltoids. He had an angry red laser burn on his cheek, looking like Indian war paint. How close had I come to losing my best friend? Come on, I said. We have to get to the armory. We need to get you boys suited up. How are we going to beat five Starkian beamships? Rollo asked, as pain flashed across his face. The laser burn must hurt. We're screwed, Creed. Everything we worked for, it's over. Not yet, I snarled. The pain had apparently made him pessimistic. Now hurry up. We don't have all day. Chapter 3 I took point. As we traveled through the metallic corridors, I noticed the flu feeling again. It pulsated in my bones, attempting to steal my strength and dull my wits. The suit tried to counteract it. I could feel each drug entering me. The toxin must be more powerful than the suit's ability to handle, though. That made me paranoid. If the android poison was too strong, the symbiotic skin could be dampening the symptoms even as the toxin killed me. I had to get to sickbay and get treated. First, however, I had to clear my battle jumper of android sleepers. Creed, Rollo whispered. What's wrong? I asked in a low voice. I had my visor open so I could hear him. There's something just up the corridor, Rollo whispered. Can't you hear it? I must have been sicker than I realized. No, I hadn't noticed anything. Now I did. From around the corner, metal scraped against metal, and I heard a purr that could only mean a flamer, a portable piece of heavy weaponry that fired heated plasma. We know you are near, an android called. We see you on our scanner. Surrender. You cannot reach the armory, and it is useless for you to die. How did you get on my ship? I shouted. The battle jumper belongs to the Jelk Corporation, the android said. It is the property of Shaklath, your owner. You must return it. Is that what you are? Property? Why do you labor against reality? You know the answer to your question. Do I? If you are Creed, know that we will accept your surrender. Shaw Cloth is eager to regain you in prime condition. The thing's trying to trick us, Rollo said. I motioned Rollo to give me his jacket. Once he did, I balled it up. Then I whispered, Get back and await my signal. Rollo retreated to the others. Have you come to the logical conclusion? The android asked. Are you ready to submit? You promise me you'll take my surrender? I asked. You have our word, the android said. Cloth will be most pleased. All right, I said. Don't shoot. I'm coming in. I edged toward the T-shaped corner and hurled the jacket. I saw a flash of silver buttons just before the jacket disappeared into the other corridor. Almost immediately the flamer whirred with sound and made a belching noise. The superheated plasma boiled through the corridor, no doubt burning the jacket in a second. I'd already backed up. The expanded plasma passed me. I felt a wash of heat through my suit and helmet. Luckily, I'd already shut the visor, 
or I might have sucked down superheated air. As soon as the ball of plasma passed, I pulled myself around the corner and fired, aiming at the tripod-mounted flamer. It would take the mechanism at least another thirty seconds to recharge for a second shot. I see him, an android said. Fire, the leader told him. My suit absorbed their laser fire for less than three seconds. At the end of that time, my beam broke into the flamer's armored core. The heavy weapon exploded with the building plasma charge. I ducked behind my corner. An orange glow like a new sun told me the plasma expanded. It made sizzling noises, meaning it ate quarter steel and androids. Portable plasma cannons were like old-time flamethrowers from World War II. Both were nasty, terrifying weapons. They each devoured enemy soldiers. The problem with both weapons was their vulnerability to enemy fire. If a bullet hit a flamethrower's tank back in the day, it could end in a fiery death for everyone nearby. The same thing had happened here to the sleepers. Finally, the glow died down like a setting sun. Be careful as you pass the area, I told the others. Everything is hot. It could burn you if you touch it. Don't worry about us, Rollo said. We passed the melted androids and the metallic, sopping walls. I saw beads of molten metal dripping like tears. One of the troopers shouted in pain then as a floating piece of red-hot plasma sizzled against his calf muscle. Another turn in the corridor brought us to the front of the armory. I opened the vault, and in a matter of minutes I had five suited troopers, not just one. What's next? Rollo asked as he sealed the helmet over his head. I'd been mulling that over. The answer depended on several factors. How many androids were on our ship and where did they attack? And where were the rest of my people? And Seven, can you hear me? I said through my helmet's comm unit. I got a high-speed chatter for an answer, and that told me all I needed to know. The enemy still blocked our communications. We stick together, I told the others. We're a hunter-killer team. Which way do we go? Rollo asked. What would I do if I were a Starkian contractor? If I could wake sleeper units on an enemy vessel, I'd go for life support first and the engine second, disabling it. But in order to do their task... Yeah, they had to keep the troopers away from their suits. The best way to do that would be to kill them. We're heading for our main quarters, I said. I meant where the majority of the troopers slept and practiced. On the way there, we slew three more androids. Then we hit another concentration of them, and it devolved into a firefight. These androids had more mass and strength than we did and they had tougher skin than the training models used on us a year ago. Even so, the androids couldn't compete against a suited trooper. That was only logical. Otherwise, Cloth would have built androids and used them for his soldiers for hire. He'd come to Earth for a reason. One of them, clearly, was that humans made excellent ground-pounders, individual soldiers with a bankouve and grenade. We proved that during the next few minutes. Lucy is hit, Rollo said, meaning the trooper who had burned her calf earlier. Her left shoulder smoked from concentrated enemy laser fire. Get behind us, I told her. She didn't want to do that, as Lucy was in the grip of battle fury. But she obeyed because she belonged to the toughest, best-trained outfit in the galaxy. The last of us out of many thousands. There had been something like 23,000 human troopers in the beginning. 168 had made it back to Earth. The lucky, the mean, the tough, and the royal bastards that nothing but atomic weaponry could take down. I'm done playing around, I said a minute later, and after a particularly nasty laser exchange with the androids. 
The bright beams had put little purple splotches in my vision. Cover me. I wanted to take out these androids now. Creed, wait, Rollo said. No. We didn't have any more time to wait. The Starkian beam ships were near Neptune. How much time did that give us here on Earth? Several days? Hours? I don't know. What I did know was that we had to kill these androids yesterday. I clicked a grenade onto the highest setting and hurled it at the final clump of androids in the game room. We'd managed to drive them into there. They hid behind metal boxes, gaming equipment, and lifting machines. Two androids leaned out, beaming the grenade as it sailed at them. Thank you, you piles of automatic crap. I shot one through the neck, a direct hit with a heavy laser. The other one darted behind the gym equipment. A third took a shot at me as I sailed into the room. The laser smoked against my symbiotic armor. Then I was down behind a metal box. My armor squirmed, and it secreted an oozing black substance that acted like a scab. Given time, the suit would heal. I slithered along the floor and tossed another grenade. None of the androids saw it, and the capsule sailed past the gym equipment before going Nova. That meant I took damage, but not as much as the closer enemies did. At your two o'clock! Rollo said. My turn came to beam a grenade, which I did from my back while shooting from the hip. An android decided for a fancy play, slithering out to meet me. He died. I leapt up toward the ceiling and caught another one trying the same thing on the floor. I beamed him in the back. Then Rollo charged into the room, followed by Hanks. We took out the rest of the stubborn constructs, and we burned the carcasses for good measure. That freed ten troopers holed up in the other room. They'd had several laser pistols, and had held off the androids just long enough for us to get here. Escort them to the armory, I told Rollo. Once they're suited, head for life support. My guess is more androids are on their way there. How many of those things are loose on our battle jumper? Rollo asked. Too many, I said. Cloth should have used them when we first stormed aboard in Sigma Draconis and grabbed the battle jumper, Rollo said. He might have stopped us that way. He was too busy at the time. I meant with Jennifer. A cold feeling knotted my gut. Jennifer was on the battle jumper somewhere. Jen was my girl. An Earth orphan. Her parents picked up during World War II during a Jelk observation run. She'd grown up as a tame human on an alien world. Trained as a nurse, she'd come back to help process millions of men and women through neurofiber surgery. The Lohar nukes and bioterminator meant she'd only helped with a few thousand surgeries. In any case, she'd held cloth at gunpoint after we'd teleported onto the battle jumper at Sigma Draconis. Maybe that's why the androids had remained hidden until now. Cloth hadn't been able to release them against us. In a way, I wish he had done so back then. We could have killed them all then, as long as they wouldn't have tipped the scales against us twenty-one days ago. Go, I told Rollo. What are you going to do? he asked. Hanks, you're coming with me. We need everyone suited and armed, I told Rollo. The more jawing, we all have work to do. Rollo saluted, the lazy two-fingered thing, and left with the others. Hanks and I traveled in a different direction. During the next twenty minutes, the two of us freed fifty more troopers, killing eight androids in the process. The alien chatter had grown less on the helmet channel. It told me the number of androids had become considerably fewer. What's happening in space, N7? I asked. Give me a status report. Our android was in the control room. There's something else coming out of the Neptune jump point, he said from the bridge. I checked my HUD map. I saw five suited trooper teams now, moving through the vessel. 
We'd lost ten people so far. Most of those techs picked off the various freighters. Can you fire our battle jumper laser at the Starkian warships? I asked N7. Fire the laser all the way to Neptune? He asked. I recalled the Sigma Draconis battle. The Jelk battle jumpers and Starkian beam ships had taken on a Lohar Guardian fleet. During the battle, I'd seen how Jelk heavy lasers had outranged the Lohar primary beams. I figured we had that same advantage here against the Starkian vessels. The only problem was that we had a single working beam, and they had brought five of their warships. Well, at least five. I wanted to be in the control room with N7. It surprised me the androids hadn't already hit the place. Yeah, I saw N7's point about range. Neptune was an insane distance. I didn't know about any alien weapon system other than missiles that could reach so far. Clearly, our laser couldn't. I'm heading for you, I told N7. I've managed to finally bring up the interior battle jumper schematic, he told me. I thought that was being jammed. It was, N7 said. I rerouted, and now I have a full interior map. Excellent. I'm transmitting to you, N7 said. My helmet uploaded through the link, and I studied the situation on my HUD. According to this, five android teams remained. We'd gotten half of them, and there were more suited troopers every minute. Okay, good. The enemy had played a surprise. They had bought themselves some time with it, but that was all. They hadn't murdered very many of us, and so far they hadn't been able to dismantle the battle jumper. On our side, we'd eliminated half the androids and gained full control of the battle jumper, or would very soon. I better recalled ship laser distances from what I'd seen during the Sigma Draconis battle. We should be able to target and hit Starkian beam ships something on the order of ten million kilometers away. The Starkians had much smaller vessels. Their beams could only reach a million or so kilometers. That was still far but not against a Jelk heavy laser. We could win this fight, provided our primary laser didn't burn out, and provided we got all the sleepers aboard our ship. I should have realized there was a third enemy option. Yeah, I should have realized it even as I hurried to the control room. Chapter 4 I floated onto the bridge. There were various stations built on a main dais in the center of the chamber. They were like a Stonehenge ring, although on a smaller scale. The lower floor circled the dais. One part of the wall down there held a giant screen, the main one. Presently, troopers manned the stations, along with one of the new engineers, an N7. He was an android. An N-series, heavy G mining type with advanced upgrades and a bio-brain. And Seven had thrown in his lot with us during the storming of the Lohar Planetary Defense Station. The android had proven invaluable to our gaining freedom, and he had become my friend. And Seven was strong, although not steel wall-punching powerful, looked like a blonde-haired choir boy, and knew far more about Jelk technology than any of us did. He was the reason why our engineers and techs had learned anything useful. As I entered, I saw Earth below on half the main screen. Morning dawned in the Sahara Desert in North Africa. The other side of the split screen showed Neptune, 4.5 billion kilometers away, and the five blue dots indicating the Starkian beam ships. The actual jump point was a small yellow dot near the gas giant. As I entered, another blue dot exited the jump point. Clearly the Starkians still had more warships coming. I wasn't as interested in the baboons at the moment. There were three red dots on Earth, showing where the last freighters rested. The other barges had already climbed into orbit. I see you've spotted the enemy flotilla, I said. 
But I doubt any radio signal came from them to us to wake up the sleepers. Agreed, N7 said. You do? Logic dictates there should be a source point somewhat closer. Have you been scanning for that source point? I asked. Indeed, N7 said. I sent Bay and Hodges on to the other side of Earth, patching through their instrumentation to us. So far, I have not detected any anomalies. Bay and Hodges each commanded a space freighter. Originally, Cloth had left the people in each vessel to their own devices. They hadn't been able to lift off then. It had made the places prison houses, with the toughest and most cunning climbing to the top. Few of the freighters had practiced democracy, but the law of tooth and claw instead. Murad Bey was a Turk, and Rex Hodges had once been a tackle for the Dallas Cowboys. I had left them in control of each of their ships for now, since we didn't have time for anything else. What about the moon? I asked N7. Is anything suspicious going on there? There are no anomalies near Luna. N7 said, although someone could be hiding on the dark side. What do you believe about the androids? Did they gain entrance from space, or were they sleepers aboard ship? Probabilities and logic indicate the stealth teams originated on the battle jumper, N7 said. Obviously, then, somebody woke them to coincide with the appearance of the Starkian flotilla. I congratulate you, N7 said. That is the most logical conclusion. Then you believe, like me, that someone is out there closer to us than Neptune? I said. I have already indicated as much. Making a fist, I tapped it against my chin. A Starkian flotilla? Android stealth teams? What else had Cloth thrown against us? This all must have originated with him. No one else among the Jelk would care enough. Still, the last time I'd seen Cloth, he'd turned into a ball of energy, burning through bulkheads and floating away into space. He'd done that to escape me. I'd tied him to a chair and tortured him for answers. He'd still been humanoid, flesh and blood, then. Could he operate like a ball of energy, communicating with regular people? Or had Cloth been forced to turn back into a flesh-and-blood creature? It seemed like a crazy question, but there was too much about interstellar space that had turned out to be just plain weird. How far out could a signal have originated to reach the sleepers? I asked. Far? N7 asked. Reasonably, I said. Taking into consideration that this was a military operation. That would depend on the sophistication of the message. We... A moment, please, N7 said. He tapped his board, checking it, and said, I have detected an anomaly in Mars orbit. Put it on the screen, I said. He complied, saying, I am amplifying the image and giving the anomaly a blue color. Earth and Neptune disappeared from the split screen. Now Mars appeared, and like a mole peering out of its hole, the blue image showed on the far left edge of the red planet, practically in the atmosphere. I am increasing magnification, N7 said. Mars grew, so we only saw a portion of the planet. The anomaly likewise gained size, and I saw it had a shark shape although minus any dorsal fin. Instead, there was a rotating dish up there. Is that a Starkian vessel? I asked. It would appear so. A cutter class. A scout. That clinches it, I said. The logical course is to destroy the scout, N7 said. I suggest we launch a missile and prepare to leave the solar system now. With three freighters still stuck down on the planet? I asked. The majority of something is better than nothing, N7 pointed out. 
I frowned and rubbed my forehead, which was sweaty and hot. What should I do? To cut and run and leave those half a million people to the Jelk Corporation. Launch the missile, I said, and launch several drones farther out toward Neptune. If we decide to head to Jupiter, we're going to want to give the Starkians something to think about. The solar system had three known jump points, one near Jupiter, another near Neptune, and the last far beyond Pluto. Each jump point led through its own route and came out into vastly different star systems. I am launching the first missile, N7 said as he tapped his board. We didn't feel anything. The battle jumper dwarfed the missiles, although they were bigger than the old cruise ship Queen Mary. How many drones should I launch toward Neptune? N7 asked. Our supply is limited. Good question, I said. We don't want to fire the drones yet if we're not heading for the Jupiter jump point. I suggest that we must escape the solar system while the opportunity presents itself, N7 said. We must therefore begin now. The Starkians block the Neptune jump point, so we must either try for Jupiter or Pluto. Do you think the Starkians or the Jelk will have warships waiting at the other end of either of those two routes? I asked. Unlikely, but possible, N7 said. I tapped my chin again, thinking. The distances involved in our solar system were huge. Light took approximately eight minutes, seventeen seconds to leave the sun and reach Earth. Battle jumper teleoptics were many times more powerful than the Hubble telescope had been. They showed us the Starkian flotilla near Neptune. That information was already many hours old, the speed light took traveling from Neptune to Earth. Something over four hours, if I remembered correctly. The same thing had occurred with the Mars Scout, but within a much smaller time frame, mere minutes instead of hours. It would appear the Jupiter jump point makes the most sense, I said, given that we would begin running now. Affirmative, N7 said. The battle jumper could get there much faster than our freighters, I said. After mulling that over, I told N7, Contact the freighter leaders. See how long it will take each of their ships to get ready for steady acceleration. N7 and several other crew members began working on that, hailing the vessels. As they did, Rollo entered the bridge. His visor was open, the helmet framing his face and laser burn. He looked concerned. I found something you might want to see. Rollo told me. We tore it off one of the androids. A commander model, I believe. What do you have? I asked. Rollo dug a small, silvery object out of a belt pouch. The thing was about the width of my thumbnail, with the thickness of a smartphone. The android was shredded junk after we were through with it, Rollo said. This thing seemed out of place. I thought it might be important, so I checked it. Interesting, I said, without touching the tiny object. What do you suppose it is? I already know. Are you ready for it? I glanced at him, curious now, and nodded. Rollo pinched the thing so his fingernails whitened, and the tiny device seemed to flicker. A closer examination showed me that it glowed on one end. Then a hazy light or a projection emanated from it. The projection spread outward several feet until a hollow image of Cloth's head appeared. The head was normal-sized for a jelk, meaning as big as a seven-year-old's. Cloth had blood-colored skin and narrow features and he had dark, extremely intelligent eyes. When he opened his mouth, one could see pointy teeth like a piranha. And the worst was the voice. If you're watching this, the image said in Cloth's arrogant manner, I must assume the androids failed. 
Well, I would call that a pity, except I will take immeasurable pleasure in capturing you. The indignities you have heaped upon my person have burned the desire for retribution deep into my psyche. You are doomed, Creed Beast. The entire resources of the Jelk Corporation will be turned against you and your pitiful species. You might have endured if you had remained faithful to your contract. Now your ingratitude has sealed your fate and that of your kind. I wanted to punch Cloth in the face. I wanted to figure out a way to kill the Jelk. I'd tried once, and as I've said, he turned into a ball of energy, burning through bulkheads to escape into space. Now the little prick was threatening me again. That seemed like a pretty fast turnaround, which was daunting. Know this, Creed Beast, the image of Cloth said. Jelk never fail. Savor your last few hours or days of life. By now you must realize that your worst fears are descending upon you. The utter extinction of humanity. That is the dreadful cost for laying hands upon my sacred person. The hollow image smiled nastily, and the eyes seemed to shine with ruthlessness. The next time you see me, beast... I will be standing over your prone form as my servant withdraws your intestines from your bowels. It will be a brutal end for a savage creature I should have destroyed the first time I laid eyes upon you. The image flickered and abruptly withdrew into the silvery object as a genie turned to smoke pours back into his bottle. I glanced at Rollo. I've been with you for years he said. And there's something I've always been wondering. It doesn't matter if we're on Earth or in space. You have a knack for making people angry. Moulin Labe, I said, speaking Greek. What's that mean? You ever hear about the Battle of Thermopylae? I asked. Of course, Rollo said. That's where the three hundred Spartans stood off the Persian army for a couple of days. Actually, it was about six thousand Greeks holding the middle gate pass through the mountains, I said. The Persians finally found a Greek goat herder to tell them about a secret path to get behind the blocking force. King Leonidas of the Spartans sent most of the force to try to block them, but it was too late. Seven hundred Thebans and others stood with the three hundred Spartans at the middle gate. The others soon surrendered, though. The seven hundred, I mean. The main army got away to fight another day. Okay, Rollo said. But what does any of that have to do with Molan Labe? The Persians surrounded the three hundred Spartans and told them to surrender their weapons. Despite our predicament here, I grinned, thinking about King Leonidas and his three hundred battered hoplites. I loved the story. Maybe I loved it more now because I could relate to it better than ever. Those had been men, those Spartans, soldiers to the very last. What's wrong now? Rollo asked. Why are you grinning like that? The Spartans were known for giving laconic answers, I said. Laconic means brief or terse. Molan Labe was probably their shortest answer ever given. It meant, come and take. Can you imagine that? Thousands of enemies surrounded them, demanding their surrender, and they said, Come and take, like giving the Persians the fingers. What did the Persians say to that? Rollo asked. Something like, Our arrows will fly so thickly that they will block the sun. The Spartans answered a second time, saying, Good, we'll fight in the shade, then. Rollo smiled ruefully, so only his upper teeth showed. Moulin Labe also meant something else, too, I said. You know how some in the U.S. government wanted to grab all our guns? I do, Rollo said. 
Well, people had begun writing Molan La Bay on blogs and stuff. It meant the same thing. Come and take. The idea being, if the government sends its agents, they're going to have to kill us first before we surrender our guns to anyone. In other words, we're going to fight to the death for our freedom, even against government tyrants. And that's our answer to the Jelk? Rollo asked. That's right, I said. We're going to stand like men to the very end. Only I'm planning to change the outcome of the story, at least compared to the Spartans. I plan on winning, not losing. I'm going to kill our Persian king. That would be a good trick, Rollo said. Yeah, it would, especially since the Starkians had already found us. I studied the main screen. It showed the jump point near Neptune. The point wavered. It meant yet another ship was coming through, maybe more. What kind of vessels are the Starkians bringing in now? I asked. Are they more beam ships? N7 made adjustments on his panel and brought up a zoom image. The regular Starkian ships were as big as city blocks. It made them much smaller than the battle jumper. That was important in a space battle. A lesser engine generated reduced wattages compared to a big one. A smaller ship also had lesser mirrors and coils, meaning a much weaker laser. This is interesting, N7 said. What is it? I asked. Show me. N7 indicated the screen. A vessel exited the jump point. It had a different kind of geometric design. That doesn't look like a Starkian ship, I said. It is not, N7 said. It doesn't look like a Jelk vessel either. I will save you time as you attempt conjectures. It is a Lohar military missile. I knew it looked familiar, I said. What kind of missile? A teleportation bomb such as we saw in Sigma Draconis, N7 said. But a bigger version than the one we used reaching the battle jumper. Teleportation bomb. The idea put a cold lump in my chest. As the name implied, the thing teleported across distances. It meant one couldn't shoot it down as easily as it approached because one minute it was far and the next it materialized right next to you. Then, kaboom! It was a tricky bit of business. What's the range of those things? I asked. How far can one teleport? An interesting question, N7 said. I will check the data banks. Did the Starkians pick those up after the battle at Sigma Draconis? I asked. We did during the battle, N7 said. Why couldn't they do the same thing afterward? I nodded. That made sense. As I waited for N7 to find the missile's range, I started feeling even worse than before. My bones felt as if they pulsated with pain. I gutted it out, even as sweat pooled under my collar. My stomach began roiling and twisting. The main hatch opened and Jen floated in. She was beautiful, with a sweet face. I particularly loved her warm hands. A healer by nature, she was the heart I had lacked. Maybe that's what attracted me so deeply to her. Hey, I said. Normally she smiled. Fear and worry showed on her face now. It put red splotches on her cheeks. Look at him, she said. What's wrong with you people? Can't you see he's sick? What? I said. I'm fine. No, you're not, she said. Ella brought me the gun, the one that fires biodegradable toxins. The sliver? I asked as I began to shake. Rollo, help me, Jen said. We have to get him into the healing tank now. He must be dying. The toxins are killing him. N7, have you come up with the distance yet? I asked. Our android said something that I didn't fully catch. 
I might have asked him a second time. I'm not sure. A klaxon began to wail. It startled me. I opened my mouth to demand to know what was going on. Then I must have passed out, because I remembered nothing after that. Chapter 5 I must have been dreaming as I floated unconscious in the healing tank. Did the dream come because of the toxins, or from the drugs Jen injected into my system? I don't know. The dream seemed to have something to do with one of our missions, one we'd fought as assault troopers for the corporation. Cloth had wanted something called the Altair object, a piece of forerunner equipment. The structure turned out to be massive, many kilometers long and wide, a torus or donut with a black hole in the center. The object had been in the middle of an asteroid maze protected by the Lohar Fifth Legion. They manned the many asteroids and the laser domes and missile pits on them. The Starkians had brought us near the maze. Androids like N-7 piloted our boats from them and we burst out on attack sleds. Our task had been to kill the Lohar Legionnaires on the asteroids. Once done, big ships could clear the space junk. The reason Cloth hadn't used massive nukes to simply blow the asteroids out of the way, I guess, was to make sure nothing harmed the artifact, and because we fought on holy ground, or in holy space. In essence, we assaulted a giant space shrine. We lost half our assault troopers hitting the asteroids, but we made the tigers flee. Until then, everyone had thought the religious fanatics invincible when faced as ground pounders. Did I mention the forerunner object had religious implications for the aliens concerning the creator? Crazy, huh? But it was the truth. I imagine creator meant God, or God to the aliens. Who would have expected loads of extraterrestrials to be zealots for God? In any case, I remember as if it happened yesterday. The Lohar legionaries fled from us, fleeing in single ships and with thruster packs, heading for the Altair object. I guess Cloth and the others called it that because this all took place in the Altair star system. As I've said, a maze of asteroids orbited the Forerunner artifact. In this case, Forerunner meant those who had come before, the first ones, in other words. As the defeated Lohars raced to the Taurus with the black hole in the center, it began to glow like the Holy Grail. That freaked me out at the time. It freaked out all of us. Then it got worse. The giant artifact became ghostly faint and then disappeared, taking the nearest Lohars with it to some unknown destination. We killed the remaining tigers. Well, the assault troopers didn't. We retreated and let the Starkians butcher them with nuclear-tipped torpedoes. Those put nice, colorful explosions on the screens like big pieces of popcorn. Since the holy object had done a bunk, the baboons could employ heavy weapons without worrying about harming the artifact. I didn't dream of the battle, as might be expected. No. I dreamt of the forerunner artifact, where it had gone. The dream felt all too real. I floated alone in space, far enough away from the object that the thing looked small. I knew it was the artifact because of the strange glow. That's exactly how it had been at the end of the Altair battle. I almost swear I could hear angels singing. I didn't want to be out here in space like this. In the dream, I drifted in my assault trooper gear, wondering how to get back to my ship. I twisted around and saw that the battle jumper was a pile of wreckage. I was stranded, adrift in space. Swallowing in the dry throat, I looked at the object again. I realized I had to reach it, although I didn't know why. I used a thruster pack and headed that way. Long before I made it to the artifact, I passed drifting Lohar legionaries. Once I happened to spy a tiger face. Horror twisted the features. 
The tiger had died petrified. I realized then all the Lohars were dead. I took my thumb off the thruster pack control. I wanted to leave this area of space. As I floated toward the artifact, I noticed a swirl of dark matter behind it. Something waited in the swirling particles. Something evil and old beyond reckoning. Nothing had told me, but I knew it had to be evil because that was the way with dreams. I twisted around, looking for stars. I couldn't see any, and that seemed impossible. There had to be stars. This is important, I told myself. You're seeing this for a reason. What reason? I licked my lips, trying to gin up courage. My suited thumb hovered over the thruster control, but I couldn't force myself to continue traveling closer. I had a hard interior debate with myself. I needed to check this out. That was the truth. So I finally pressed down my thumb. Instead of feeling the pack push against me, light blinded my eyes. Horribly bright light. What did that signify? Creed, darling, a sweet voice said to me. Terror coursed through my body. Was that the Creator? Did He speak to me? I felt grossly unworthy for this. Creed, you must wake up. It's time. Huh? Wake up? Help me, Rollo. Help me lift him out of the tank. I heard liquid slosh, and then I felt a stab of cold on my bare shoulders. Someone tore a mask off my face, and I breathed canned ship air once more. A whiff of my girlfriend's perfume finally broke the dream spell. I opened my eyes to medical banks, cots, tubes, hypos, and Rollo helping me toward a length of bed with white sheets. I left a trail of puddles on the deck plates. Jen toweled me off before pushing me down and pulling covers up to my chin. The sheets were smooth and clean. Then I recalled the dream. The object... I said weakly. Rest, Jen said, smiling tenderly. What happened? You were very ill, she said. You should have come straight to sickbay after getting shot. She frowned. If the android had pumped more slivers into you... The thing almost killed me? Yes, she said, with a warm hand against my cheek. I wanted to ask her something important. Instead, my eyelids closed and I slept. My lids snapped open a few minutes later. Well, I thought it was a few minutes. It turned out being three hours. What happened? I said, my voice sounding raspy as if I gargled sandpaper. Jen turned around. She stood beside a table, inspecting something I couldn't see. She smiled. It put dimples in her cheeks. She came around the table and walked to me. The grav plates were working then. Good. We could employ hard maneuvering if we had to. Jen sat on the edge of the bed and put her hand on my forehead. You're not hot anymore, she said. There were klaxons before, I said. Which ones? she asked. There's been several emergencies. On the bridge, before I went down. What's been going on? You almost died, she said. I mean with the ship. Oh. She turned away and picked up a communicator, clicking it on. Rollo, he's awake. In a few seconds, Rollo towered over the bed. You okay, buddy? He asked. I flexed my left hand and glanced questioningly at Jen. Your body is still healing, she said. You might feel lightheaded for a day or two. You should rest. 
I flung off the covers and sat up. She was right, though. I felt dizzy. I closed my eyes, but that didn't help the pain in my mind. Did you get the scout? I asked, meaning the one at Mars. You haven't been out that long, Rollo said. Our missile is still accelerating at it, and Seven believes the scout will remain behind Mars instead of trying to make a run for it. That means the missile will have to decelerate before it can swing around the planet to make the attack. That's smart on the scout's part, I said. I scowled. There was a klaxon before, while I was still on the bridge. What happened? Did the Starkians use one of the teleportation missiles on us? Not yet, Rollo said. According to N7, the missiles have a similar range to our main laser, about ten million kilometers. They can possibly teleport farther, but the mechanisms become more unstable the farther they try to materialize. If they become too unstable, they reappear scrambled and useless. So why did the alarm sound? I asked. Rollo frowned, putting lines in his forehead. He used to have a long, thin face. Now it was puffier due to the steroids. Oh, yeah. We spotted a second scout. Another Starkian vessel? Rollo nodded. I cursed. How many scouts did the baboons have sprinkled throughout the solar system? Perhaps, as importantly, how long had the scouts been here? You need to relax, Jen said. You shouldn't get yourself excited. Your body needs time to fully recover. I glanced at her. I loved Jen, but... No, no, never mind. I'm not going to say anything negative about her. She was a good person, a healer, in love with a killer. The innocent rabbit living with the wolf. Sometimes I wondered how we could make a go of it for the long haul. The second scout was near the Jupiter jump point, Rollo said. It darted into it and left the solar system. That was even worse. I lurched to my feet and swayed as if drunk. A warm hand steadied me. Creed, Jen said. The Starkians not only know we're here, I said. They've obviously gone for reinforcements and down a different jump route than the one they used coming here. Yep, Rollo said. That about sums it up. We have to leave Earth, I said. Rollo nodded. But does this mean we should head for the Pluto portal? I asked. If we do, we're going to have to face the beam ships and their teleport bombs. And that's the consensus. I mulled that over before asking. Are any of the last three freighters in orbit yet? Nothing has changed with them, Rollo said. In my opinion, they're grounded forever. I muttered to myself like an old man hating a new idea. By the way, Rollo said, Diana has been trying to get a hold of you. It sounds urgent. Who's Diana? Jen asked. Rollo answered for me. She's a freighter leader, one of those still grounded on Earth. Creed talked to her before he left on our first corporation mission. She liked what Creed said and has been organizing her people for prolonged resistance. Against the Jelk? asked Jen. Yep, Rollo said. She's one of Creed's strongest supporters. Jen glanced at me, and she wasn't smiling. I ignored her for now. I had enough problems to deal with. I didn't want to bring jealousy into this. There's something else, Rollo said. I heard it in his voice. This was why he'd been waiting around for me to wake up. Let me get dressed first, I said. You should rest, Jen told me for the umpteenth time. I can't rest, darling, I said. This is go time but I appreciate your concern. You're risking a relapse, she said. I laughed, and I pulled her to me and kissed her on the lips. Then I gave her a good squeeze. 
She felt great. Thanks, I whispered in her ear. I'm really glad I have someone around who worries about me. Now I have to do my part and keep you safe. She hugged me and looked up into my eyes. I could see her fear and worry, but she nodded. I grabbed her butt and gave it a squeeze. Since the first moment I laid eyes on her, I knew I wanted her beside me. What were you working on at the table? I asked. The ammunition, she said. What ammunition? The one shot into you. That's a good idea. I put on the rest of my clothes and tested walking. I could feel the dizziness threaten my equilibrium, but less than earlier. You have something to show me? I asked Rollo. Outside, yeah, he said. I got the feeling he didn't want Jen to see or hear about it. So I asked, You've been searching the ship, like I said? That's right, Rollo said. Let's go. We left Sick Bay and walked down the corridor until we turned a corner. Then I stopped, leaning against a bulkhead as I faced him. Maybe Jen was right. What do you have? I asked. Rollo handed me a cardboard thin tablet, small like a smartphone with a tiny keyboard. What's this? I asked. I showed it to N7, Rollo said. He believes it's a long-range communication device. The thing's memory has a list of operable and inoperable battle jumper weapon systems. I'd been turning the device over in my hands, tapping it with a fingernail. It was made of a light metallic alloy. I looked up. One of the android assassins had this? That's right. What does N7 think? That the android sent periodic updates to the Starkians with it, Rollo said. Thus, they know we have a crippled battle jumper. Yeah. Rollo said in a western drawl, as if he had a toothpick dangling in his mouth. We're not going to be able to bluff them. Who said anything about that? I asked. I'm just saying. Wait a minute, I said, eyeing him. It's more than that. If they know we're crippled, maybe they really will try to capture us. There's that, too, Rollo said. Despite the trick the android with the flamer tried to pull, I think Cloth really does want you back. Maybe he wants us all back. I helped you torture him. It makes me nervous thinking about falling into his hands. I think we have to run for it, Creed. It's crazy for a busted battle jumper to try to take on seven beam ships and however many teleportation missiles the Starkians have. You want to run? Hard, fast, and far. Rollo said. What about the three freighters on the planet? This is a hard luck story all the way around, he said, no longer looking me in the eye. We have to save what we can. I studied the android device. I'd had plans earlier to give the freighters some weapons, old Earth nuclear missiles modified for space. A couple of MX missiles or SS-20s would give the freighters close-range punch. The missiles would be like shotguns, good for giving a hard wallop of a blast to anyone who came too close. The Starkians, or the Corporation, wasn't giving us time for anything tricky, though. Cloth had done the right thing from his perspective. The longer he took hunting us down, the more we could learn and the tougher we would become. I don't know about cutting and running, Rollo. That's half a million people we're talking about. You want to just leave them for the aliens? No. I want to survive. I want the human race to survive. We've already lost most of it. What's a few more? Are you serious? He looked at me and looked away again. This is a messed up universe. Yeah, I want to save them. This is a fight to the finish. But we have to have a chance for victory if we're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. Who said anything about that? I asked. 
What's your plan, then? It's pretty simple, I said. We outdistance the Starkians with our primary laser. That means we shoot them down before they can close with us to hurt the battle jumper. They have those teleportation missiles. Those might trump our laser. I recalled the Battle of Sigma Draconis all too well. The joke lasers had taken a heavy toll of the Lohar Guardian fleet. They had sent the teleportation missiles, which blinked out and appeared before the battle jumpers. The atomic explosions had taken their toll of the Jelk vessels. We have to rig something up for that, I said. If we know what they're going to do... I snapped my fingers. Maybe we can build a minefield with old nukes from Earth. How would that work? Rollo asked. I was thinking on my feet, off the cuff. It would be easy, I said. We put detonators on those old warheads and salt them in layers before us, up to whatever N7 figures is the Lohar warhead blast radius. When a Lohar T-missile materializes, boom, we blow it apart before it can ignite. Rollo scratched the back of his head. Huh. That could work. That forces the Starkians to bore in at us, I said. While they do, we laser them as I first suggested. Ergo, we win the fight. Provided our weapon lasts long enough, Rollo said. We're going to have to work overtime to get ready, I said. During that time, we have to get those three freighters into orbit. The techs have been over them. Nothing works on those old scows. Let's change up the idea. Okay. Maybe we need to take grav plates out of orbital freighters and reinstall them in the bad ones. That at least gets the freighters into space. You're just guessing, Rollo said. You should talk this over with N7. See what he says. I recalled the dream of the Forerunner artifact. Cloth had wanted it very badly. I wondered why he did. I also wondered why I'd dreamed about it and thought about it now. Was my subconscious trying to tell me something? How much time did N7 say before the Starkians are in range of our laser? I asked. The Starkians aren't killing themselves to reach us. At the present rate of acceleration? Four days. That includes time for deceleration? I asked. Yep, Rollo said. Crazy alien tech. It had taken mankind in the Apollo days that long to reach the moon. Grav plates and powerful acceleration made a ton of difference. We don't have much time, I said, as I ran my fingernails against my cheek. I need to pick up extra techs from the orbital freighters and bring them down onto Earth. And we have to collect nuclear warheads. Oh, and we need to rip out some grav plates. Are there any thermonuclear weapons left down there? Rollo asked. Didn't we fire them all off the day Earth died? We're going to find out, I said. Come on, we have to hurry. Chapter 6 I piloted our least damaged assault boat, plunging through the atmosphere, heading for Baja, California. Intense colors swirled around us, red, orange, and purple. As they swirled, our boat rattled and lurched one way and then the other. There were powerful winds outside. It reminded me of the day the aliens first landed, when I attacked them with Rollo beside me while carrying an M-14. We'd been in Antarctica during the end of the world. Penguins had already started dying in their tens of thousands. I'd wanted to go out with a bang that day, and I'd wanted to hurt the world killers. I still wanted to hurt them, but I'd changed my mind about going out with a bang. This was for human survival, not revenge. You might want to slow down, Rollo said. We wore our symbiotic armor as a precaution, and I took us down as if we were on a combat run. Dying won't aid us, Rollo said while hanging onto the straps crisscrossing his torso. We plunged down into a dead world. 
In a little over a year, the bio-terminator had killed even the tiniest spores. Mars probably had more life than Earth did now. I had a plan for that. We'd accomplished step one, freedom. Step two had been gaining our own spaceships. Check. Most of the vessels were junkers, though, and low on fuel. Our battle jumper needed massive repairs, as it had taken heavy damage during the Sigma Draconis fight and later with our teleportation attack. We lacked funds to pay for alien dockside repairs, and we lacked goods to barter for it. Step three would be getting funds or goods. I planned to do that the old-fashioned way, by stealing them. Or, in our instance, through Viking raids against alien worlds. Problem. I only had two hundred troopers. Well, a few less, actually. Solution? The freighter has held millions of Earthers. I could recruit more and train them. Problem? I didn't have time for training just yet. Another problem. The leaders in the freighters controlled their people and wouldn't want to give them up. If they did give them up, they might try to slip their own people into my little army. Hang on, I said. I banked the assault boat sharply, plunging even faster. Are you crazy? Rollo shouted. The vessel shook and rattled more than before. The glass covers over my gauges vibrated, making them seem to jiggle. All the motion helped me collect my thoughts, helped me to focus. As I said before, most of the freighters ran along tooth and claw rules. The leader was a ruthless bitch or son of a bitch and kept a vicious pack of henchmen nearby. He or she kept order like a prison lord. That meant many people aboard the freighters likely hated the leader. It also meant the best recruits, the toughest people, already worked for the boss man or woman. I didn't want a Trojan horse among my assault troopers. The troopers were my political strength, the reason I ran the show instead of someone else. Still many of the have-nots and the freighters were likely just as tough as the henchmen. The survivors had been in the out-of-the-way places like Antarctica, the Arctic, Greenland, submarines, and military outposts. Far more men than women had survived. With training and neurofiber implants... Question. Could Jen and the other nurses do the surgery on any volunteers? I sighed. My laundry list of things to do seemed never-ending. Soon I was too busy piloting the boat through vicious cyclones to do much thinking. The Lohar thermonuclear devices, and especially their planet wreckers, had changed the weather patterns for the worse. Like the best plans, mine was straightforward. Ella and Dimitri commanded the majority of the assault troopers. They presently scoured the battle jumper, hunting for more hidden sleepers. We'd beaten the android stealth assault. Unfortunately, we'd lost too many badly needed techs and a handful of troopers. It meant we were down to 151 effectives. I'd visited ten orbital freighters collecting techs and grav plates before heading down to Earth. They were my payload, and they would go to work on Diana's freighter in Baja. I didn't plan to talk to her, though. I was too busy for that. Another assault boat had collected techs and brought them to the battle jumper. They helped with repairs. Our battered vessel's shield was still down. By shield, I meant an electromagnetic screen. The Starkian beam ships had those. We had some hull armor, some hull, and lots of useless, empty ship to destroy before any blast or beam reached the engines. None of that would matter if our laser outranged theirs for the entire fight, demolishing them before they could fire. Let me make this sweet and short. Rollo complained about my piloting until we landed near Diana's freighter. He went outside, escorting the shaken tax to a hatch. Fifty-five brilliant men and women entered the grounded scow, ready for some hard repair work. Soon, a forklift and suited driver appeared. She carried the grav plates to an engine bay. 
and took five trips before the hatch shut for good. By that time, Rollo had returned to the boat. After the scrubbing and decontamination, he sat down beside me, took off his helmet, and gave me a look. I had ignored my comm unit the entire time he'd been in the freighter. Diana wants to talk to you in person, he said. I shook my head. Why won't you see her? he asked. Is it because of Jennifer? I revved the engines instead of answering. A minute later, we lifted, heading for the first missile silo in what used to be near Mino, North Dakota. Working overtime and after the first twenty-four hours, while powered on stimulants, we hauled eleven nuclear warheads aboard our boat. It took three trips down and up to get them onto the battle jumper. There, Tex attached the warheads to gel ejectors. We could fire them from torpedo tubes, laying down a pattern. It meant we could create an operable minefield in an hour or so, by launching the ejectors and easing the warheads into place. So far, the fifty-five extra Tex hadn't had any luck with the grounded freighters. I had a short talk via screen with the chief engineer on Diana's scow. I was in the battle jumper control room, staring at a small monitor in my station. A crazy zigzag kept slashing through the screen, but I tried to ignore it. Reception was never good with those down on Earth. The chief tech was from India, or from what had once been India. She'd been to school in Germany and knew her stuff. She also had the darkest eyes I'd ever seen. I think her name was Gupta. I am surprised this freighter made it down to Earth, Gupta told me. The electronics are in shambles, and the seals. She shook her head. I need a week, Commander. Maybe more before this thing will fly again. You don't have a week, I said. You have a day. She took her time answering. I watched American shows while I went to school, she said. The old space adventures. This isn't anything like them. When I say a week, that is exactly what I mean. Don't expect a miracle because you say we need it. But I do need it. Gupta's dark eyes flashed angrily. With all due respect, Commander, I'm tired. My people are exhausted. We all are, I said, cutting her off. Now listen carefully. Get the job done now, or give it to someone who can. Gupta wasn't backing down. Like most of the survivors, she was made of stern stuff. N7 could not make the ship fly any faster. Do you want me to relieve you of command? With both hands, Gupta rubbed her face. I knew I pushed her. Sometimes you had to set the bar too high. That way people strove diligently to reach it. If that burned her out, we failed anyway. But by not pushing, we failed. So one had to demand the impossible in impossible situations. She took her hands away from her face. Do not relieve me. I am the best at this you have. I listened to N7 when he made his explanations, not just pretended to listen. You do realize that... I realize bloodthirsty aliens are bearing down on Earth, I said. I don't want to leave anyone behind. I'm counting on you. Those people in the freighters are counting on you. Take chances if you have to. Risk. Maybe you are right. You know I am, I said. Creed out. As Gupta's image flickered and disappeared, I rubbed the back of my neck. It had a kink in it that wouldn't go away. You push them too hard, N7 said. As we stood at our stations, various engineers crawled here and there, fixing panels and adding various pieces of new instrumentation. I'd had enough resistance today, and just like Gupta, I was tired. What would you know about being pushed? I asked. You're an android, not a man. And Seven raised his eyebrows. You are upset at my words. 
That is an indication you are exhausted. I suggest you rest. Yeah? Is that what you suggest? And how do I manage such a trick? I'm too wound up to sleep. All the more reason for you to relax, N7 said. It was my turn to rub my eyes. Being in charge was different. Before, Cloth had kept his thumb on us, and particularly on me. I knew how to react to that. It was my natural heritage, I suppose. I'd been to prison as a youngster and disliked authority. The only thumb pressing down on me now was the pressure of the Starkian flotilla. They had passed Jupiter's orbital path, still building up velocity as they came toward Earth. There's an incoming message for you, Commander, Ella said. I don't remember if I've told you about Ella. She used to be a Russian scientist. Now she was an assault trooper. Despite the steroid 68, Ella was still thin, with a pretty face, dark hair hanging to her cheeks, and a mind like a razor. She liked things you could cut and weigh, using the scientific approach. I didn't know much about her previous life. I knew I could count on her when the chips were down. Right now, that's all I needed to know. Put on the main screen, I said. Ella did, and I found myself staring at the Starkian commander, Naga Gobo. As N7 had once told me, Naga was his name and Gobo was his rank. It meant Lord of Ships. A regular Starkian was the size of a baboon and looked as furry and as ugly. Naga sported two long canines at the end of his wrinkled muzzle. He must have weighed sixty or seventy pounds and had a mane like a lion. His had white streaks in it. I don't know what that meant about his actual age, just that he was old for a Starkian. Naga Gobo sat on a dais with raised controls around him. Others moved behind the dais. I knew the place stank, because Starkians did. When I'd met them in person before on a beam ship, the chamber had smelled like a filthy zoo cage. Naga Gobo seemed to be what he looked like. The dominant male of a high-tech baboon pack. Instead of clothes, he wore a harness around his body, with various tools or weapons hanging from it. Instead of a handkerchief and a breast pocket, he had a silver tube with a black ball on the end dangling there. I wish to speak to Creed Beast, Naga said on the screen. He fit perfectly into Jelk Corporation thinking, having a low opinion about humans. I let the insult pass for now. The time would come to teach him differently. I'm Commander Creed, I said stepping off the control deck onto the lower plates. Is this subterfuge? he asked. Explain yourself, I said. He stiffened at my tone, saying, You all look alike to me. How do I know it is really Creed Beast I address? I do not understand, Ella whispered behind my back. How can we be communicating instantaneously with him? He's near Jupiter. His radio wave should take an hour to get here, and our reply an hour to return. That is an intelligent question for an animal, Naga said from the screen. You should put her in charge. Just a minute, I said. I motioned for N7 to mute sound. Once he did, I asked, What's the answer to Ella's question? It would appear he is using Lohar teleportation communications, N7 said. I have heard of the technique, and am surprised to realize it is factual, not fiction. What are you talking about? I asked. It is complicated theory, N7 said. Do you wish me to explain the details? No, I think I understand. They teleport the radio waves at us and somehow teleport our replies back to their ship. 
That is crudely stated, N7 said, and it is not altogether accurate. Still, I suppose it is close enough to the truth for an operating understanding. Wonderful, I muttered, before scowling at Naga Gobo. He kept calling us animals and beasts. I'd never liked that while I'd been a corporation slave, and I sure didn't like it now that I was free. I'm getting tired of their arrogance, I said. It's going to be a pleasure killing them. We must negotiate, if we can, N7 said. Or we must at least attempt it. They outnumber our ships and surely have greater firepower. Once they get in close, you mean, I said. Correct, N7 said. I don't know. Do you really believe negotiating is worth the effort? I would not have said it otherwise, N7 said. Sure, I said. I'll keep that in mind. Unmute the baboon. N7 did so, causing a beep to sound from the screen. I took a wider stance and put my hands on my hips, letting them rest on my belt. So you're Naga Gobo, huh? The last time I saw you, you looked more impressive. Maybe it's because we met in person aboard your flagship. I smiled. I imagine Cloth is pretty pissed off at you Starkians about now. Naga glanced at something to the side on his vessel, something we couldn't see, before regarding me again. Your voice modulation matches with our records. You are the loathsome creature I seek. I have a list of complaints against you. I have a list of my own concerning you. Naga hooted to someone off-screen. Then he wrinkled his snout and leaned toward me. You are in the inferior position, Earth Beast. Therefore, you are advised to watch your tongue. Inferior, huh? Is that why I'm standing in a corporation battle jumper? You stayed one of the chief items on my list. That of robber. You must return the stolen property in as good as condition as the day you lifted the vessel. Secondly? Secondly, I said, speaking louder. If you pass Mars's orbital path, I can no longer guarantee your safety, or the safety of your little band of beam ships. Naga Gobo blinked at me like a kicked dog. You dare to threaten a representative of the Gel Corporation? Third, if you so much as scratch the paint on my freighters, I said, I will hold you personally responsible for the damage. Since monetary rewards mean little to me, I will recoup the losses with my knife. I drew it, showing him the buoy. With this blade, I will personally peel off your skin and nail it to my bedroom floor. Every time I think of you, I'll wipe my feet on the fur. Naga Gobo stared into my eyes. His became bloodshot as his mane stiffened. Slowly, he opened his muzzle, and then he began to shriek with rage. Like some zoo specimen, he pounded the dais before him, hooting, screaming, and jumping about. You have excited him, Ella said. Was that your intention? I shrugged in order to maintain my pose. She'd nailed it, though. In a fight, it was often a good idea to enrage your opponent, so he made foolish decisions. Besides, I was tired of him calling me an animal. If they wanted a beast, they were going to get one, but not in the manner that they imagined. The shrieks and hoots finally died down until Nagagobo panted. His eyes were red-rimmed and evil-looking. I will purchase you from Sharkloth. Then, human, I will make your life miserable and painful. You will long for death and— I'm tired of your jabber, I said. Do you have a message for me or not? He glared, panting faster, with saliva dripping from his fangs. 
Finally, he stirred and said, Surrender your ship at once. Come and take, I said. You cannot defeat my beam ships. Saying it doesn't make it true. Only a fool would speak as you do. Is that what you truly believe? I asked. You think it's impossible for us to win? Well, that will make our victory that much more impressive. If you trust in Jelk technology, know that I have the codes to interrupt your ship's interior functions. Just as the androids slaughtered your crews, so shall your failsafe bring you to grief at the worst possible moment. Is he so simple that he gives away their plan? Ella whispered. I didn't respond. I just watched the agitated Starkian. This was getting more interesting by the moment. Naga looked the way. It appeared as if someone addressed him too quietly for us to hear the words. Finally, the Starkian stared at me again. If you feel I've given you valuable information, you are quite wrong. No doubt you're right, I said. Your damaged vessel doesn't have a hope against us. I'll try to explain this simply so you and your crew can understand, I said. We were down and out about twenty-three days ago, so-called animals stranded on a planetary defense station. All we owned were the weapons in our hands and our wits. With that, we took Cloth's own warship. Have you considered the implications carefully? Do you wonder why the little Jelk hasn't come to take us himself? In case you can't figure it out, I'll help you. It's because he's frightened of us. And for good reason. Your boasts are absurd, Naga Gobo said. Cloth doesn't come because he hasn't yet regained... A Starkian voice shrieked from the background, sounding like a crazy high school librarian. Naga Gobo turned toward the voice. A flurry of words passed between them. Finally, the Lord of Ships faced me again, looking chastened. You have animal cunning, Naga said in a low voice. I will grant you that. You have also achieved a notable feat. I refer to your capture of the Jelk Battle Jumper. I congratulate you on your valor. This was an odd twist, the compliment. What did it mean, and why did he try it? I decided to play along and see what happened. I accept the honor you give me, I said. Because of your change of attitude, I will reevaluate mine towards Starkians. Yes, you are a free people. It is a noble thing to be free. Naga's eyebrows thundered, and he leaned closer yet toward the screen. You are a shifty creature. Being. A shifty being, he said. Yeah, it's been said. A moment, Nagagobo said. He muted his sound and jumped off the dais. Soon, four Starkians sat in a group. They pounded the floor with the flats of their hands, jabbering at each other. May I interject a thought, Commander? Ella asked as we waited. Of course, I said. They have the appearance and possibly the mannerisms of beasts. But it would be good to remember that they are driving starships with the capability to destroy us. Your point? I asked. Don't underestimate them. I don't plan to, I said. In time, Naga Gobo climbed back onto his dais. The sound returned, and he stroked his mane as he regarded me. Let us speak as warriors, the Starkian said. I waited. Do you agree to that? He asked. I greet you, Naga Gobo, a warrior chief of the Starkians. It took him a moment, and then Naga said, 
I greet you, Commander Creed, an assault trooper of the Jelk Corporation. I let that pass. He wasn't trying to insult me now. At least I didn't think so. You know I have the codes to your battle jumper, Naga said. I know that most of your systems are already damaged beyond repair. Yet you achieved an amazing feat back in Sigma Draconis when you captured the ship. Perhaps Shah Klaath does not recognize the daring and the courage your actions took. We of the Starkians appreciate it. Because of that, we will make you an offer. I'm listening. Surrender your battle jumper and your assault troopers. We will let the freighters go. Clearly, many are in working order. Perhaps they can find a home elsewhere, or perhaps they can take up a Starkian-like existence. Without warships to guard them? I asked. Having guardian craft would be better, he said. But surely my offer is superior to their destruction or capture? I am not convinced you can destroy us. Come, come. Naga Gobo said. Our advantages trump yours. I suspect that's true. But we are free, and you're planning to make us slaves. Free men do not easily accept the slave color. Not even to save your race. A moment, please, I said. It is granted. Naga Gobo said. I turned to N7. With the press of his forefinger and an audible click, the android muted the speaker. Does he make the offer in good faith? I asked N7. It is difficult to tell, he said. The Starkians are known to keep their oaths. I imagine it depends on whether or not he truly believes your people. A man's word doesn't mean anything if given to an Indian, eh? I asked. I do not understand your reference, N7 said. It happened several hundred years ago when the Europeans came to the New World, I said. That's the only Earth analogy I can think of to help guide me here. I don't trust him, Ella said. No, I said. But if our sacrifice can buy humanity life... Ella looked away. I advise you to reject the offer, N7 said. Without military protection, the people in the freighters will not long remain free. I inhaled through my nostrils. Give me sound, I said. Naga Gobo looked up. It is time for warriors to fight, I told him. You refuse to surrender. Do you? I asked. He appeared perplexed. I do not understand your words, he said. Will you surrender to us? I asked. That is a ridiculous proposal. There's my answer. He stared at me for a few more seconds. You cannot win, he said. You believe your position strong enough to fend us off. But that is because you do not understand the full situation. Go ahead, then, I said. Explain it to me. I'm listening. A different Starkian muttered off-screen. Nagagobo deflated. You were given the chance, he said. You must remember that. It is now on your head. You're in my solar system, I said. Don't think you're going to escape it alive. I tried to offer you safety, but you have rejected me. Remember that. Foul creature, he muttered. And Naga Gobo made a sharp gesture. A second later, the connection broke, and the Starkian beamships continued their path toward Earth. Chapter 7
The next two days became a blur of activity. During it, N-7 monitored our missile's approach to the Red Planet. The Starkian scout finally made a run for it, blasting away from the far side of Mars with hard acceleration as our missile ended its first braking schedule. Waiting until our missile had expended most of its fuel was a good idea. At least, that must have been the scout crew's thinking. The scout accelerated for the braking flotilla. Nagagobo had reached the inward edge of the asteroid belt and needed to rid himself of excess velocity. Like a hound chasing a burglar, our missile increased acceleration for the scout. The missile would no longer have to swing around Mars to try to catch the enemy by surprise. This was a matter of velocity, a race. Could the scout reach the flotilla in time for the beam ships to destroy the missile with their million-kilometer range? Naga Gobo made another communications appearance. After a preliminary greeting, he said, Let our conversation be brief. I'd only slept a few hours these past days. My eyelids felt like sandpaper every time I blinked. The good thing was that one of the downed freighters had lifted off-world. It joined the other freighters behind Earth, behind the planet in relation to the approaching flotilla. Diana still demanded to speak to me. Her scowl remained on the poisoned surface. I'm listening, I told the Starkian. The scout is innocent, Naga Gobo said. The crew merely observed you. Why destroy it needlessly? I laughed before I could control myself. You mock me? Naga asked, bristling with red showing around the whites of his eyes. He was trying to save his scout. That was reasonable enough, I suppose. Hold up, chief, I said. There's no mockery intended. I just don't believe you're asking me this. You accuse me of lies? That's not what I meant. But now that I think about it, yeah, I do accuse you of lying. How dare you insult me of— Hey, I shouted. Nagagobo blinked in surprise. Killer androids attacked my personnel on the battle jumper, I said. One of the things even carried a message from Cloth, telling it to me. I'm wondering who activated the hidden killers. We found their sleeper tubes, by the way. We even found a few extra ones that failed to wake up destroying the things before they changed their minds. Do you know what we found? The sleepers had activation features built into their skulls. Who turned them on by beaming a long-distance message? I'm guessing it was someone in the scout. The scout crew beamed a message, I admit, Naga Gobo said. They were go-betweens, innocents. No. In my book, sending the message that activated killers was like launching a missile. Instead of a metal tube, this missile came in radio waves. That means the scout crew is no longer innocent bystanders. They drew blood. Now they're going to have to pay the ultimate price for failing. Heed me, Creed Beast. So we're back to insults, are we? Naga Gobo shook his head. I will drop all pretenses. You are an animal. Thus, it isn't an insult to speak the truth. Did you build the battle jumper? No, you stole it. Have you risen into space technology through your own intellectual efforts? No, you... I get your point. Maybe it's time you understood mine. If you kill humans, we come and kill you. Heed me, beast. If you cannot show mercy to our scout, I will not show mercy to your freighters once I demolish the battle jumper. I never expected any mercy from you anyway, I said. It does not have to be this way, Naga Gobo said. A moment, Commander, N-7 said. May I speak with you? I turned to N-7, finally nodding. N-7 muted the screen. Commander, he said. 
I would accept his offer. Show the scout mercy so your freighters may survive. That's a screwy deal, and you should know it. He's telling me I can't hit our attackers, or he's going to commit genocide against us. That shows he doesn't have a conscience. Therefore, why should I believe him when he promises something? You spoke of genocide, N7 said. You should accept his promise because the returns are so high, and you give so little in return. You're missing the point, I said. He doesn't get to decide when I can kill his boys or not. Anyone who comes at me with a knife in hand, especially a blade wet with human blood, I kill. There are no deals unless he backs off. Offer him that, Rollo said. Good idea, I said. And Seven put him back on. Have you finally come to your senses? Nagagobo asked me. I'll tell you what, I said. Turn your flotilla around and don't come back, and I'll let your scout live. Do we have a deal? Nagagobo didn't respond immediately. I am under contract, he finally said. I must gather Cloth's stolen property and return it to him. I must finish what I began. The scout crew's blood is on your head, then. With a snarl, Nagagobo made a motion. The connection ended. Two hours and thirty-three minutes later, our missile's warhead exploded. The thermonuclear charge sped along targeting rods before annihilating them, beaming gamma and X-rays at the fleeing scout ship. Shortly after, the small craft disintegrated. First blood, Rollo said. Second, I told him. The android assassins took first blood. First ship death, then, Rollo said. Yeah, I said. It is that. Commander, N7 said, I suggest you sleep to regain your stamina. My analysis suggests the battle will not begin for another sixteen hours. I felt strung out like a paranoid addict awake for seventy-two hours. My eyelids kept drooping on their own account. It wouldn't help us if I couldn't think straight. The freighters gathered behind Earth, getting ready to make a run for the sun. From there, they would slingshot to the Pluto portal. I didn't give them high odds for long-term survival if we failed to defeat the Starkians. But at least they had odds. That was better than dying right off the bat. I left the bridge, staggered down the corridors, and collapsed in my bunk. I went down hard and slept a solid twelve hours. When I got up, I felt worse than ever. Was that an after-effect of the toxins? I don't know. I searched out Jennifer, and we spent an hour together. It might be the last time we'd ever have with each other. Later, I went to our makeshift gym and ran a few kilometers, working up a sweat. I showered afterward and ate a big meal. I was finally starting to feel better. On impulse, I put on symbiotic armor and grabbed my bonkoove, my laser rifle, making sure it was fully charged. Only then did I head to the bridge. The second-to-last ground fighter lifted from Greenland and joined the others in time for the initial acceleration. It was just us now and the battle jumper and Diana and her people down in Baja, California. That was insane. Earth had become a desolate planet. If we beat the Starkians, could I really turn the world back into a paradise? Like everyone else, I used to bitch about lousy TV shows, poor fast food, and the rain. Before the Lohars showed up, we Earthers had killed each other in wars, mugged those richer than us, and insulted one another for a thousand different and usually petty reasons. It wasn't that funny. I miss the old Earth. I miss the teeming cities, the fierce political debates, the yelling, the honking, everything that made us human. In an angry frame of mind, I walked into the control room. 
The aliens had stolen all that from us. Now they wanted to take the table scraps, too. You know the saying. Over my dead body. Let's get the show on the road, I said. And Seven, I have no doubt you've been analyzing their attack run. I have, he said. Let's spread out our minefield, then. I watched the main screen. The ejectors used hydrogen propellant. That meant they were cold, not hot and harder to spot by enemy scanners. We had one battle jumper, with three assault boats ready as escape pods. Our laser could reach ten million kilometers. For good measure, we had a dozen missiles left, the big ones like we'd used on the scout. I hadn't seen any reason to launch them at the beam ships. The Starkians would just laser them. No. I was saving the missiles for a better opportunity. On the big screen, I watched the enemy flotilla approach. Nagagobo had seven beam ships. They came in a cluster, four leading and three following. By the orange glows around them, each had an electromagnetic field. The beam ships protected three Lohar teleport missiles behind them. Well, they were liberated ones anyway, no longer Lohar property. Any surprises so far? I asked N-7. The teleport missiles are unsettling, he said. Tell me why again? It is an unstable technology, N-7 said. The Starkians are a nomadic race. They are therefore cautious and conservative. It is unlike them to take a technological risk. Cloth must have ordered it. I do not accept that, N-7 said. The Starkians are contractors. They do not accept orders they do not like. So the missiles are unstable, I said. So what? Perhaps the Starkians will program one wrong, and the missile will reappear among them instead of materializing near us. That would cause grave devastation to the beam ships. They need something to beat our laser, I said. The T-missiles are it. They already have something, N-7 said. They're shields. Something more than that, I mean. You appear to be correct, N-7 said. I refer to fact of the T-missiles, but I am not convinced we have the entire answer as to why the Starkians are using them. What are your suggestions? I asked. None other than what we are already doing, he said. Sure, I said to myself. Great. Time slowed down. It always does when you want it to speed up. The freighters began their play, accelerating at full throttle for the sun. I wondered if we'd ever see any of them again. A bad feeling came over me. I walked away from my station and stood before the main screen. Putting my hands behind my back, I stared at the stars. With the battle jumper, I stood between survival and the apocalypse. It made my gut clench, and I hoped I was making the right decisions. Creator, I whispered, if you're listening, I ask for a fighting chance. Don't let the Starkians wipe out the human race. Give us another play at life. I stood there for several minutes and finally returned to my station. There was nothing to do now but wait. The Starkians didn't launch any missiles, and neither did we. The enemy flotilla is thirteen million kilometers away, N-7 reported twenty minutes later. I suggest we run the engines at three-quarters capacity and begin to warm our laser coils. Do it, I said. Soon the interior ship thrum increased substantially. I felt the vibration under my feet, and the noise grew until a loud and sustained whine made my spine uncomfortable. It took gobs of power to make the laser kill at ten million kilometers. Targeting, I said. Are you ready? Affirmative, Ella said. Do we know which one is Nagagobo's vessel? I asked. Negative, 
Ella said. Which ship sent the message? I asked. It may not be that simple, Ella said. He may have moved to a different beam ship. And seven? I asked. The choir boy android tapped a finger against his console. That seems like a reasonable precaution, he said. Yeah, and maybe Nagagobo didn't take it, I said. Aim at the ship that communicated with us. Let's make him earn his survival. Time passed. Eleven million kilometers, N7 said. The Starkian flotilla bored in toward Earth. It would appear they plan to do their heavy braking once in their own laser range of one million kilometers. At their present rate, they would flash past the planet and us. Do you think they mean to chase down the freighters? I asked. We have not found any more scouts, N7 said. I do not believe they know of the freighter maneuver yet. The Earth still blocks the Starky inside of them. The enemy could have guessed our intent, I said. It is possible, N7 said. Great, I whispered. They're almost in range, Ella said. Get ready, I said. And make sure you destroy the first ship before you start on the next. Better that we utterly destroy them ship by ship and that we damage all of them but leave them intact. The next few minutes dragged as if I were a child again, sitting beside the Christmas tree, waiting for my parents to wake up so I could open the gifts. Would our laser hold long enough for us to burn through seven shields and seven armored hulls? Ten point one million kilometers, N7 said. Fire, I said. Let's do this. Ella touched the targeting screen and a new noise burst into existence. Power rushed through the coils, energizing the giant laser cannon. The whine was low-pitched at first. It rose rapidly throughout the ship. Then a huge ray of concentrated killing light stabbed into the void. The enemy wasn't in range yet. It didn't matter. He would be when the light reached its targeting point. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. That was roughly a little over three seconds per one million kilometers. The tip of our laser would reach ten million kilometers in a little over thirty seconds, half a minute. Ella targeted where the enemy beam ship would be in that time. It called for fantastic targeting capabilities. It would have been far beyond twenty-first century human tech, but it was within the parameters of Jelk battle gear. The obvious question no doubt rears its brainy head. Why not jink, moving random patterns to throw off enemy targeting? The answer was equally pointy-headed. Because at the velocity the Starkians came, jinking caused too much G-force stresses to the vessel itself, never mind the crew within. I had to wait more than a minute for Ella to yell, Hit! We're burning through the electromagnetic field! Thirty seconds to reach the target and thirty more seconds, roughly speaking, for our teleoptics to see what was happening. The first beam ship's shield turned from an orange glow to a deeper red color. Starkian generators likely pumped power to their electromagnetic field, attempting to hold. Our laser put energy, heat, on it. Some of the power bled away from the point of impact, discoloring the enemy shield in a wave pattern. Where the beam burned, the shield turned from red to black. Here was the question. A simple formula, really. How much energy would it take to burn through a shield, the hull behind it, and destroy the beam ship? The answer would tell us if we had a chance or not. If we did have a chance, our engineers would have to make sure our laser could beam for the entire battle. Ever since Nagagobo's boast, our techs had worked, putting in new battle jumper codes and rerouting many of the systems. If he could jam us with a computer virus, we had to know, and then foil it beforehand. The minutes ticked by. The Starkians kept coming, and the first enemy shield finally overloaded. Our sword of light stabbed the beam ship's hull, melting the outer alloys and digging deeper, deeper. A silent explosion heralded the first Starkian vessel's destruction. 
Like a slow-motion grenade, it burst apart with glaring, flaring light behind it. Sections of hull parted. Water, globs of bubbling steel, plastics, fiery fabrics and pieces of flesh and shattered Starkian bone fragments blew outward from the central mass. Radioactive gamma and X-rays also smashed against the nearest Starkian vessels. Those beam ship's shields glowed red with overload. That's beautiful, I whispered. The beam ships are like bombs in the middle of their formation. The baboons have kept them too close together in order to shield the T-missiles. The laser, sir, Ella said. I went cold inside. I hope you're not going to tell me it's overheating. No, sir, she said. I'm retargeting for the next beam ship. Commander, N7 said. I have run the computations. If we can continue to destroy them at this rate, we will win the battle. I shouted triumphantly as if I'd won a jackpot on a Las Vegas slot machine. Rollo and a few others also roared. We can do this, people, I said. We can beat the aliens at their own game. I should have known better than to jinx us. Commander, N7 said. One of the Lohar teleportation missiles is appearing. I balled my right-hand fingers into a fist and struck my console. Get ready to ignite the nearest warhead, I said. On the main screen, I saw the Lohar missile, a big, bad thing of hostile intent. The missile sped toward us. Soon it got close, well within 100,000 kilometers of our battle jumper. That was sharp teleportation targeting. What's happening? I asked N7. Our nearest warhead doesn't respond, the android said. I suspect the T-missile... Before N7 could finish his sentence, the teleportation bomb activated. The thermonuclear reaction beat ours to the punch. It went nova, turning into incandescent light. I shielded my eyes. I needn't have bothered. Our teleoptic equipment automatically filtered out harmful light. It's huge, Rollo said. Two hundred thousand megatons, N7 reported. Get ready for impact, I said. Heat, radiation, and a powerful electromagnetic pulse sped toward us. As they did, the combination swept over the other Earth warheads we'd painfully put into position as an atomic minefield. The blast is neutralizing our warheads, N7 reported. Then it reached us. Temperatures soared on the outer hull. The EMP hit our hardened electronics. The bridge lights flickered. Sparks flew from Rollo's station. I kept striking my console. Damn, damn, damn! Why couldn't we have beaten the T-missile to the punch and blown it apart? Well, I asked. Are we finished? Did they win? Ella looked up, her features unreadable. The laser is still operational, Commander. Our team retracted the main cannon behind an armored bulkhead. We put it away before the T-missile blew. How long until we're ready to fire the laser again? I asked. Five minutes, she said. That's not good enough, I said. Make it three. The light stopped flickering and came back on as strong as ever. Damage report, I said. I have to know if we're still in the battle. Commander, N7 said. I've run an analysis. The T-bomb materialized too far for full effectiveness against us. You mean they made a mistake? I asked. Yes, Commander, N7 said. They won't next time, I said. Do we have any ejectors left with warheads? Two, N7 said. Get one of them out there. N7 attempted to relay the message to the torpedo crew. He looked up at me. Commander, the tubes are blocked, destroyed. I couldn't believe this. Everything had been working a few minutes ago. How long until the tubes are operational? I asked. Not until the battle is over, 
and Seven said. What? No. Tell the crew to haul an ejector to a shuttle bay. They can launch it manually. Our N-series android stared at me. That is an excellent suggestion. Tell them to hurry, I said. If the Starkians are smart, they'll launch another of those things now and finish us for good. A minute later, that's exactly what happened. The laser is almost ready for firing, Commander, Ella told me. And seven, do we still have a margin for error? I asked. It is one-tenth as large as previously, N7 said. After he spoke, I saw a wavering space on the main screen. I knew what it meant. we just witnessed it a few minutes earlier. As before, a teleportation missile materialized in close range. Ella, I said. Can you retarget the laser at the T-missile? Not fast enough, she said. With impotent rage, I watched the teleportation missile solidify. This one didn't have the same velocity as the approaching beam ships. That should have been impossible. How had the T-missile managed such a trick? I didn't know. Seconds ticked by. The T-missile had not only materialized, but it sped toward us. How come it hasn't ignited yet? I asked. I'm picking up life readings. And Seven said. Come again? I said. Commander? And Seven asked. He hadn't been built on Earth. He still didn't know all our idioms. What are you talking about? I asked. What life readings? Where are they coming from? The android frowned. He even had a line in his forehead, a thick one. The life readings are coming from the T-missile. And Seven said. Say again, I told him. Before N7 could manage, the T-missile burst apart. It didn't do so as before with a thermonuclear explosion. The missile parts flew away as if ejected by magnetic force. Smaller pieces like interior pellets began to break, causing long fusion trails to burn at us. What are those pellets? I asked. I'm analyzing, Commander, N7 said. Ella, get the laser back online now. Quit hiding it behind the armored bulkhead. That's what I'm doing, Commander, she said. It's almost ready. N7, I said. I'm still waiting for an answer. What in the hell are those things? The pellet shapes burst apart as the T-missile had, through the power of magnetic force. In the pellet's place were several thousand individual soldiers. At least, those sure looked like soldiers in heavy-powered armor. Is what I'm seeing real? I asked. I do not understand this, N7 said. The readings make no sense. Tell it to me anyway, I said. N7 looked up from his board. He looked as confused as the android ever did. While his face was human-like, the mobility of his features lacked our range of differences. I'm tracking Lohar life readings, N7 said. As in Lohar legionaries? I asked, dumbfounded. Yes, N7 said. Tigers? I asked, as if that would clarify the situation. Yes, Commander, N7 said. Those are Lohar legionaries flying toward our battle jumper. It is my belief they are attempting a storm assault. Why are the Tigers aiding the Starkians? I asked. I thought Lohars hated the pirates. They do, N7 said. I find this inexplicable. I stared at the main screen. Is this what it had been like on D-Day for the Germans? Staring into the sky and seeing thousands of allied paratroopers coming down on their heads? This didn't make any sense at all. Chapter 8 Listen up, I snarled. I see Lohars coming for our battle jumper. I don't know why they're so far out from us, but we're going to use that against them and take the Tigers down hard. As I spoke, 
another T-missile materialized in close range. We'd spotted three of them coming through the jump point near Neptune. Therefore, this seemed like the last one we'd have to deal with. It reacted as the second missile, spilling more breaking pellet-shaped craft, which in turn put more Lohar power-armored legionaries into space. How many of them are you counting, N-7? I asked. Five thousand, he said. This is an entire legion. Perfect, I said. How are the ejectors coming? Have they launched one yet from a shuttle bay? You're going to blow a nuclear warhead among the enemy? Ella asked. You're reading my mind, I said. I want your laser back on target. We have more beam ships to kill if we're going to win the fight. N-7, tell them to launch the second ejector. It's possible the Tigers have anti-missile tech. I drummed my fingers on the console, debating whether to use some of the regular Jelk missiles I'd saved. If the Legionaries reached us... We launched three more missiles, the big Jelk ones. If we lost the battle jumper, I'd never need those missiles anyway. The minutes flashed past. Soon our ship-killing laser burned into the void. It seemed like the spotlight of Death Search, the grim interplanetary game. Just as good, I watched our first ejector accelerate toward the cloud of approaching Lohars. This seems reckless and senseless on their part, I said. Do you think the Jelk captured the Lohar soldiers at Sigma Draconis and have forced them into service? I do not deem that as likely, N-7 said. Lohars are notorious and well-known for fighting to the death. They would never surrender to Jelk. Just like they fought to the death in the Altair system? I asked. If I recall correctly, Lohar legionaries fled from us like wet hens. The Altair episode still does not compute with me, N-7 said. No, I told him. You should say it doesn't make sense. To say it doesn't compute makes you sound like a computer. You may not be human, but you're no computer. Finally, our laser began torching the second Starkian shield. At the same time, an ejector approached the Lohar mass of soldiery. I was feeling hopeful again. But some of those legionaries must have been carrying semi-portables, infantry heavy beam weapons. Rays flashed in the darkness, hitting our warhead. Should I ignite the ejector? N7 asked. It's still too close to our battle jumper, I said. The blast will hurt us. You must decide quickly, Commander. The enemy's semi-portables burned against ejector armor, chewing into the heavy plating. More rays appeared, adding their help. The legionaries that fired the lasers no longer came at our vessel. Their individual mass was practically non-existent compared to the beam wattage, which acted like a propellant, pushing the shooters away from us. Do it, I said. Explode the first warhead. It's too late, Commander, N-7 said, as red from his panel flashed against his face. The Lohars destroyed it. I came to an immediate decision. Accelerate the three Jelk missiles. Let those reach the Legionaries first as decoys. We can't allow those warheads to explode this near the battle jumper anyway. We have to get our Earth nuke among them if we're going to save ourselves. The Jelk missiles will simply take all of us down. After N-7 made the adjustments, he came upon a startling discovery. You'd better look at this, Commander, N-7 said. What now? I asked. There is another vessel coming through the Neptune jump point. More Starkians? I asked. Negative, N-7 said. It is a Lohar dreadnought. The words didn't register right away. Maybe because of my confusion, my head swiveled away from the main screen, so I faced our android. What did you say? I'm magnifying the image, N-7 said. You should see this for yourself. I regarded the main screen again. I couldn't believe what I saw. 
The dreadnought looked exactly like the monstrous vessel that had attempted to wipe out the human race a little over a year ago. It seemed as big as Rhode Island or a large asteroid. This one had fins like a 57 Chevy, but it was a metal construct, a thing aliens had built. That just came through the Neptune jump point? I asked. The image is over four hours old, N7 said. Otherwise, that is affirmative. I didn't know what to think or say. Commander, Ella said. That's the same jump point the Starkians used to reach our solar system. She was right. That was weird. Is the Dreadnought hunting down the Starkians for taking Lohar soldiers? I asked. I believe we should hail the Dreadnought, N7 said. They should have the superior Lohar Comtech, allowing near-instantaneous communication. Speaking with them might clarify many things. I walked off the command deck toward the main screen. What was going on? What had happened at Sigma Draconis after we'd left? What are you going to do about the approaching legionaries? Rollo asked. They're going to board us soon if we do nothing. They've already managed to take down one of the Jelk missiles, and they're beaming the other two. This changes nothing, I said. We're still going to blow up the Legionaries. A Lohar Dreadnought is coming, N7 said. We cannot defeat such a vessel. It may be unwise to kill so many Lohar Legionaries within their visual range. I whirled around toward the others. Blow them up, I shouted. The Lohars destroyed our planet and most of our race. We're going to kill them because of that. Ella, detonate the Earth warhead. Do it now before they destroy the last ejector. The color drained from Ella's face. Her mouth opened, maybe to speak. She was a scientist first. Maybe I asked her to do more than she was capable. It was one thing to fire a laser at an enemy vessel. That was impersonal. You destroyed a machine. You could block the idea of killing all those people aboard. With the Tigers coming at us individually, there was no way to fool yourself about what you were doing. I dashed onto the command deck, shouldering Ella aside. Commander, N7 said. The Dreadnought Captain is hailing us. He wishes to discuss terms for our surrender. I'll give him terms, I said and I tapped the red image on the board. The legionaries coming in their individual thousands used semi-portables and rifle lasers to disable the last of the three Jelk missiles. Now a mass of beams shot toward the final ejector. I ground my teeth together in frustration. Was it already too late? Lokar legionaries were considered some of the finest fighting soldiers in this arm of the Milky Way galaxy. They must have trained for such a tactic as I used against them. Then, outside the battle jumper, the nuclear warhead originally constructed to detonate against Chinese or Russians blew up against the alien world killers. I sagged in relief. That was the first reaction. The second was to grin like a maniac, fiercely glad to destroy alien bastards. I wanted to take down the entire race of Lohars if I could. They'd try to annihilate us. I would destroy them whenever I had the chance. The thermonuclear blast lacked the punch of the first T-missile, our own Jelk warheads. On the other hand, it ignited closer to our ship than the first alien warhead had. Even so, the battle jumper's laser survived the explosion, and so did we. The Lohar legionaries coming for us? Not so much. The front mass of them disappeared in a fireball of atomic annihilation. It was beautiful. Others farther away blew backward, carried by the wave front of flying particles. Many of the powered armor suits melted away, exposing tiger flesh. I imagine that those who kept their suits intact boiled like lobsters in a pot. Others looked like machine-gun victims, their suits riddled by speeding particles. My grin continued to widen like Little Red Riding Hood's wolf. 
Did that make me despicable? Maybe it did. I was a soldier, an assault trooper. The jail had trained me to kill. I was doing my job. If I did my job well enough, the human race survived. If I fouled up or got soft, we died. So if I happen to enjoy my job, well, that's the breaks. I'm the one who had to live with it. I'm the one who stood in the breach for mankind. If you feel you can judge me, go ahead. If I have nightmares sometimes because of the things I've done... No, forget it. I'm not apologizing to anyone. At least not yet I'm not. I killed the incoming legionaries because I did my job for keeps. Commander, N7 said, the dreadnought captain wants to speak with you. Tell him I'm busy. I tapped Ella's board and I brought up the far-range teleoptics. I did it in time to witness our laser burning through the second Starkian shield. Soon the second beam ship exploded, and this one seemed to damage a third vessel. We're doing it, Rollo said. We're killing them. I raised my right eyebrow questioningly at Ella. Quietly, she returned to her station as I moved aside. The Lohar captain demands your attention, N7 said. He is very insistent. I took a deep breath. What's this dreadnought doing? I asked. Accelerating for Earth, N7 said. What's his flight time look like? He had a greater initial velocity upon entering the solar system. He should be here in a day. Of course, it depends if he plans on breaking or if he will chase down our fleeing freighters. I had to reach out and steady myself. It hit me then what had happened. The Lohars were back in the solar system. I became lightheaded and felt like vomiting. The Lohar dreadnought was returning to Earth. Had the captain come back to finish what he'd started a little over a year ago? I checked the others. Rollo looked pale, and his right eye twitched. It did that sometimes when he became frightened. Not that he'd ever admit to the fright, and not that I'd ever call him on it. Well, I couldn't worry about the dreadnought now. We fought the Starkians. One battle at a time, right? Hmm... Now that the baboons were out of T-missiles, we could beat them. The flotilla of theirs, anyway. There was no way I could destroy the tiger dreadnought. If I recalled correctly, the Lohars didn't have too many of those. Was that the same ship that had polished off my old man? I shook my head. None of the dreadnought questions mattered. The Starkians. The tigers have never spoken to us before, Ella said. To finally talk to them would make this an historic moment. I scowled. That's why Mad Jack Creed had gone up in his shuttle that day. During their first visit to our solar system, the Lohars had acted like the Sphinx, silent and inscrutable. We desperately wanted them to communicate with us. They ignored every plea and brought about Armageddon. This is an opportunity for us to study them, Ella said. You must speak to the Lohars, Creed. What can you lose? Keep targeting the Starkians, I growled. Finish them. I understand your single-mindedness, Ella said. But you must broaden your approach this time. We lack data, and we will be dealing with the Lohars shortly, if we survive the Starkians. I watched our laser stab a baboon shield. Maybe I could do two things at once. The dreadnought would be here soon enough. Our scientist had a point. All right, I told N7. Open a channel with the tiger. Let's see what he has to say. Nagagobo also wishes to speak with you, N7 said. Forget him, I said. He's dead to me, and good riddance. Maybe he wishes an alliance against the Lohars, Ella said. Shouldn't we pursue all options? No, I said. Nagagobo had his chance. 
He played his last card and found himself with a losing hand. The way I see it, he reaps the reward of gambling and failing. Like candles in the dark, we're blowing them out one by one. But, Ella said, you know we can't afford to do anything less, so we risk the battle jumper. Besides, his beam ships won't make any difference against the Lohars. An alliance with him is meaningless. I'm putting the Lohar captain's image onto the main screen, N7 said. I ran my fingers through my hair. I was going to do what my dad had tried to do and failed. Talk to the Lohars. On the main screen, the latest beam ship with its blackening shield disappeared from view. A proud Lohar military officer stood in its place. A large flag with zigzagging lightning bolts wavered ever so slowly behind him. It reminded me of the times the President of the United States used to address the nation. The Lohar was taller than we were, I knew, a little over seven feet tall. He was broad-shouldered and muscular. There were subtle differences to his face, so he didn't look exactly like a bipedal tiger. For one thing, the brain case was larger and the features more narrow. His eyes were yellow, with tiny slits in them. The uniform was black and orange, with golden braid and shoulder tabs. He wore medals and carried a large blaster on his hip. The cap stood higher than a human would have it, and had a crest on the front of crossed blasters, with a tiger's clawed paw in the background. Well, instead of paws, it had fingers, or a cross between fingers and paws. The Lohars were clearly into fancy dress uniforms. That was interesting right there. The jaws moved, but no sound came. Like a bad old Japanese movie, the voice was out of sequence with the lips. The tiger must be using a translator. I'd spoken with Corporation Saurians who had done the same thing. At first it was disorienting, but I quickly became used to it. I wish to address the Battle Jumper's commanding officer, the Lohar said in a deep voice. I put my right hand on my chest. That would be me, I said. The Lohar studied me intently. Do you possess a name of office? I'm Commander Creed. The Lohar cocked his head. That is the officer's designation? Commander is my title. Creed is my name. I comprehend. I am. The Lohar turned sharply to his left. He blinked his eyes several times. The fur around his face stiffened. When he regarded me again, his eyes seemed to shine with rage. How do you do that? Rollo asked me. In less than a minute, the tiger already hates your guts. That's got to be a record. You detonated an atomic warhead amongst the 121st Legion, the tiger said. You vaporized my men. Oh, boy, Rollo said. Those were yours? I asked. I'm sorry. I thought they were renegades who had hired out to the Starkians. I thought you'd be glad for what I did. The tiger worked his jaws for several seconds, and his shoulders hunched as he lifted his arms. He was the picture of a Lohar ready to pounce and rend to death. You are barbarian swine, the tiger spat in feline fury. Not only did you butcher them, now you attach degradation to noble warriors who died for the Lohar pride. Pride? I whispered. You humans call it empire, N7 said. A Lohar calls it pride. Oh, I said. The Starkian scum would never command pride legionaries, the tiger spat at me. Soldiers of the race possess honor and loyalty. On oath to the Creator they serve the Jade League and protect this quadrant of the galaxy. Needlessly murdering them is a barbaric offense of the First Order. 
besmirching their holy honor is a crime beyond words. So sue me, I said. Genocide against humanity was no big deal to them, but if one singed a few tigers, they became a holy terror. I was sick of the double standard. The Starkians are attacking us, and then teleport missiles appeared nearby, disgorging legionaries for a storm assault, I said. The facts spoke for themselves. The Lohars worked for the Starkians. Do you lack all objectivity? the tiger asked. The Lohars do not hire themselves to Starkians. I have forced Nagagobo to do my bidding. I don't know if my mouth dropped open. Probably I looked like a fish out of water, making futile gasping motions. My worldview took several seconds to readjust. In a moment, the floor became the ceiling. Yeah, okay, I was beginning to see it. This had been a tiger operation from the beginning, not a Jelk or Starkian show. So you're saying the Lohars reversed the military decision at Sigma Draconis? I asked. Barbarian swine... We all but destroyed the Jelk's devilish offensive thrust. They paid a bitter price for their infamy, even if they gained the information they sought. Hold on a minute, I said. I have to think this through. N7 muted the screen, even though the Tiger Lord continued to move his jaws, to rail at me, no doubt. What do you make of this? I asked N7. I believe the Lohar, N7 said, as that would explain how Nagagobo acquired the T-missiles and legionaries. I nodded. Check. That made sense in this screwy part of the universe. It means Lohar reinforcements must have appeared after our departure from Sigma Draconis, N7 said. More from the Lohar's words I cannot glean. What do you think the Jelks sought in Sigma Draconis? I asked. The Lohar says they sought information. I got that, I said. What kind of information? I do not know, N7 said. Perhaps you should ask Nagagobo, Ella suggested. You really want those baboons to survive, don't you? I asked. I abhor senseless slaughter, she said especially when we can gather useful information instead. I faced the screen. Ella had her points, but I had mine, too. And Seven reconnected audio. I wanted to shout at the tiger. I wanted to laugh in his face. The situation demanded cool thinking, however. The invincible dreadnought changed everything. I'm unfamiliar with you space races, I said. I don't know your customs or legends. Lohars fight hard. I know that much. And you dirty bastards nuke worlds. I don't know why you've hailed us, but I originally called to demand your surrender, the tiger said. I snorted. Now I am reconsidering withdrawing the offer he said. I didn't want to jump to conclusions, but had the destruction of the 121st Legion frightened him? The Lohar didn't act frightened. Why would he withdraw the demand to surrender, then? For such barbarity, the tiger said, I desire your deaths, not your capture. Oh. Wait a minute, I said. You call us barbaric? You're the ones who attacked an unarmed planet. You sprayed a bio-terminator on a defenseless people. Mine. I'd say that's barbarity of the First Order. You state inaccuracies, the Lohar said. What? Your people didn't launch nuclear missiles at us? Of course I did. You did it? I asked, with fury making my voice shake. I noticed N7 switch to a split screen. On one half, I watched another Starkian beamship explode. 
On the other, the tiger spoke to me. I stand proudly by my military record, the Lohar told me. I have acted honorably throughout. You're kidding, right? You are an insufferable creature who spews insults and slurs, the tiger said. I am the High Lord Admiral of Dreadnought Indomitable. I never joke or kid, as you suggest. I am a lohar of intense gravity and seriousness. I'm sure you are, I said, licking my dry lips. I needed to get a handle on the tiger. I couldn't see what he wanted. Maybe to destroy the last of us, to finish what he'd started. Why did your tigers... Why did your legionaries attempt to storm my battle jumper? I asked. You cannot be that dense. The reason is obvious. Hey, listen to me, I said, finally deciding how I was going to do this. I'm Commander Creed. We don't use fancy titles like you Lohars because we're too serious-minded. I am the highest-ranked human in the solar system. You will address me with honor and decorum, with gravity, or I'm ending this dialogue right here and now. The Lohar glared, and, if it was possible, he stood straighter and more stiffly. I finally noticed a teal-colored medal pinned to his uniform. It glittered with a harsh inner light. I don't know your protocols, I said. I don't pretend to know how you think. Barbarian, he muttered. That's another thing. You will not call me a barbarian or swine. If you do, I will begin using the same terminology regarding you. You would not dare, he said. I laughed. Sure I would dare. I have nothing to lose. He stared at me, and he opened his mouth only to close it. The Jade League is at war with the Jelk Corporation. We desire an enemy battle jumper. And that's why you tried to storm mine? It looked as if he grinded his back teeth together in frustration. You will surrender the battle jumper to me, he said. You will do so at once. I almost told him, come and take. But I had to think of the fleeing freighters and their precious cargoes. Are you trying to tell me that in all the years of fighting the corporation you've never captured a battle jumper? The Admiral turned his head and appeared to watch an unseen screen. He soon regarded me again. You will cease at once your attack upon the Starkian beam ships. I don't think so. We are parleying, he said, as if pointing out a key argument. Your continued attack is a dishonorable... Hold it right there, I said. Let's get something straight. I can see you're big into honor, but you Lohars destroyed a defenseless planet. That doesn't strike me as honorable, but... as the opposite, I said. Cease attacking the beam ships or the parley ends. Nope, I said. Nagagobo activated androids on my ship. The assassin slew some of my crew, my people. He's going to pay for that with blood. Ever since your cowardly assault on my world, I've vowed to make aliens pay ten thousand-fold for every human death. If Nagagobo released stealth androids on your battle jumper, he did so against my direct orders. I guess you have less control of your hirelings than you think. I said. The Admiral snarled with frustration, so bits of spit flew. The Lohar could be lying to us, Ella said. I do not lie, the Tiger said. To suggest otherwise is to besmirch my honor. What honor? I asked. You destroyed an unarmed world, mine. My assault on Earth followed the conventions of war, he said. You will immediately cease these slurs upon my military conduct. 
That's some honor code you Lohars have managed to invent. That's all I have to say. I hear you speak, but I do not understand your meaning. How many times do I have to say it? I asked. You dropped nuclear bombs on a defenseless world. What's honorable about that? You are mistaken, the tiger said. Your world was massively armed. Large quantities of missiles lofted to attack us. Perhaps you mean to say that your weaponry was antiquated and feeble. That does not mean you were unarmed. I figured the British during the colonial era must have used the same logic when using a Maxim machine gun on spear-armed natives in the Congo. A spear against a bullet would have had a better chance than Earth did against a Lohar dreadnought. Commander, N7 said, Nakagobo begs an audience with you. Hi, Lord Admiral, I said. I'm going to consider your offer of surrender. You do not know the terms yet. I want to talk about the concept with my crew. The Admiral's head jerked back. But you told me you were the highest ranked, the commander. I am, I said. Then your words strike me as pretense. Give the order and your inferiors will follow. We don't play the game the same way you do. Commander Creed out. I turned around. Cut the connection. N7 did so. Put up Naga Gobo, I said, while glancing at Ella. He has three ships left, Ella said. I should inform you that our laser is overheating. Take it offline for a moment, I said. Let them think we're going to do this their way. We are not, N7 asked. I think our days of doing anything are just about over, I said. Therefore, I plan to kill as many of these aliens as I can. Thank you, Commander Creed, Naga Gobo said as he appeared on the big screen. He looked worried and fearful. I would like to offer my abject surrender to you. Okay, I said. Drop your shields. The baboon blinked at me. Commander, you have not yet accepted my surrender. Consider it done, I said. Yes, of course, Commander. But what assurances do I have that you will not continue to fire on our ships? None, I said. But— Drop your shields, or I'm going to think you're just buying yourself time to get within your beamship's range. No, no, he said. I assure you that is not my intent. I desire life. I— Did you hire yourself to the Lohars? I asked. He stared at me for just a moment. Yes, of course, he said. Did the Lohars defeat the Jelk fleet at Sigma Draconis? Naga Gobo tugged at his mane, and his manner became shifty. That is prized information, he said. Forget about your games or about stalling, I said. Either tell me what I want to know, or I'll know you're up to your old Starkian tricks. A Lohar mobile fleet arrived several hours after your departure from Sigma Draconis. Nagagobo said. Did Dreadnought Indomitable show up with them? No. No? I asked. Are you sure? Nagagobo appeared perplexed. The Lohars do not normally use their Dreadnoughts in fleet actions. What are you talking about? I asked. The Dreadnoughts are survey vessels. Meaning what? I asked. Exploratory ships, he said. They are the offensive arm against the Jelk. I massaged my forehead, wondering what the baboon meant. I felt out of my depth, as if there were mysteries swirling around me of which I had no knowledge. Did the three Jelk commanders escape from Sigma Draconis, or did the Lohars kill them? I asked. All three Jelk escaped. 
They always do. Nagagobo's remaining vessels will be within beamship range in twenty-nine minutes, N7 said quietly. Without turning around, I nodded. What do the Lohars want? I asked that baboon. I assume you mean here in your solar system, Nagagobo said. Exactly, I said. Nagagobo shook his head. I do not know. I merely know they hired us to make an assault so they could launch their legionaries and capture your battle jumper. Lohars do not confide in Starkians. What was your hiring price? I asked. Nagagobo tried to look imposing, but he couldn't pull it off. They captured the majority of my fleet in Sigma Draconis. If they can capture your battle jumper, they will free my fleet. And if you fail? They will destroy the ships and the Starkians in them. You're not really going to surrender to me, are you, Nagagobo? I am. I swear it. The rest of your fleet in Sigma Draconis will die if you surrender to me. And I will live, he said. No, I don't believe you're that venal. Commander, I implore you to listen closely, Nagagobo said. The Lohars want to capture you, all of you. I do not believe they mean to kill the last humans. Isn't that excellent news? Knowing it, you should be merciful toward the Starkians. We used to be allies, after all. What's really going on here? I asked. Your actions make me believe you're not telling me everything. Naga Gobo hesitated, giving me time to think. One of the killer androids you released gave me greetings from Cloth, I said. How did it know to do that? How did you gain Jelk codes if Cloth didn't give them to you? It must have been a pre-recorded message. Naga Gobo said. I laughed. Did he think I was stupid? The laser is ready, Ella said. I glanced at her. A green light on her panel shined against her face, highlighting her cheeks. I think you're right, she said quietly. I believe he's trying to deceive us so his beam ships can get within range of our ship. Turn him off, I said. No, wait! Nagagobo shouted. But N7 broke the connection. I faced my command crew. Does anyone have any suggestions? From what I know, N7 said, I find it incredible that Lohars used Starkians. Their loathing for the pirates is well known. Yet it doesn't seem that Nagagobo is lying about everything. Why otherwise did his flotilla possess teleporting missiles and the 121st Lohar Legion? The Dreadnought Admiral corroborates his story about an ultimate Lohar victory at Sigma Draconis. All this, I said, waving my hand, seems like a pretty elaborate ploy just to capture our battle jumper. I noticed that originally Nagagobo wanted to find our commander, Ella said. I think he wanted to find out if you were here. Me? I asked. Why me specifically? Maybe the why would give us the reason for the ploy, Ella said. I don't know, I said. With the Dreadnought here, I think the Lohars mean to finish their task of eliminating humanity. I think we're doomed, and I think running is out. The question for us is this. How do we want to end our lives? Go down in a blaze of glory? Rollo asked in a rough voice. I don't see what else there is, I said. Then keep bargaining, Ella said. If we're going to die, if humanity is on the verge of extinction, then engaging in futile acts of martial valor does nothing other than assuaging your soldier egos. I concur with Ella, N7 said. I glanced at Rollo. The massive trooper shrugged. It doesn't matter to me, Rollo said. I just want to make sure we're not captured and tortured. After that, I want to kill as many aliens as I can. 
Okay, I said. It's one thing bargaining with the Lohar Admiral. He seems honorable in his own way. The Starkians? I don't trust them at all. They're going to be in range soon. I say take them out and see what the Admiral has to offer. That's incredibly harsh, Ella said. But I don't see an alternative. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, I said. I agree with you, Rollo said. Kill the Starkians. They mean to kill us. They are sly, N7 said. Destroying them is the most prudent course of action. I don't trust them, Ella said. But shouldn't we continue to bargain while we have an opportunity? Who knows what new data we might receive? I exhaled sharply, took several steps, and said, Bring the laser back online. Let's clear out the beam ships. Once they're gone, I'll talk to the Admiral. If the Lohars really hate the Starkians that badly, I don't think the Admiral will lose any sleep with the pirates' deaths. Chapter 9 I never did talk to Naga Gobo again. At my orders, we destroyed the last three beam ships. Soon the Starkian flotilla was gone, a smear of space debris in our lonely universe. Silence fell upon the control room as Ella took the laser offline. I wanted to tell them we'd done the right thing. Could we have trusted the slippery Starkians? Really trusted them? What could we have done differently? The Starkians couldn't have brought the beam ships to a halt before reaching the million-kilometer mark. Nor could I have allowed the flotilla to veer away. They could have gone after the freighters then. No. They had entered the solar system and killed humans. Whether the Starkians did that under duress or not, they had lied to me all down the line. The fate of the freighters was too important to gamble with if I didn't have to. Instead of gambling, I killed every last one of the alien enemy. Still, it was one thing to blaze with rage in the middle of a battle, quite another once you realized that your actions had slain thousands of sentient beings. Maybe I could hide behind my medals like the Lohar High Admiral. Instead of honor as my excuse, I used human survival. I don't know. What's the point of hand-wringing hindsight? I gave the orders and the Starkians were dead. I had to live with that. Were the Cherokees right, though? Did a man own a conscience, and every time he went against it, did he wear it down a little bit more? I'm guessing so. I felt hollow inside when I should have felt ecstatic. Maybe I hadn't fully turned into a cold-blooded butcher yet. I had to give it time. You had to do it, Rollo said from his station. Ella's head snapped up. No, do not put it all on his shoulders. We did it. We all did it. I'm not sorry we did, Rollo said. We had to. We all know that. So why are we feeling bad about it? Because we're human, I said. You're the history buff, Rollo said. You gotta know there were plenty of killers in the past who didn't give a damn about something like this. This was our job, folks. If we'd failed, I'd... I don't know. Commander, permission to leave the bridge. Where are you going? I asked. I want to get drunk, Rollo said. He tugged at his collar, which was tight around his thickly muscled neck. I think I earned that, he added. You did, I said, but not just yet. We have a bigger crisis afoot. Our laser will do no more against the dreadnought than my dad's radio beam did a year ago. And seven, put the Lohar vessel on the main screen. The massive dreadnought appeared against the backdrop of stars. I don't understand, Ella said. How can it be so big? Is that a serious question? N7 asked. They used large construction techniques and... 
I understand that part, a Russian scientist said. Think of what it takes to build a warship hundreds of kilometers in depth and width. Think of the sheer mass. It must be like moving a very large asteroid. Ella shook her head. Are there millions of lochars in there? Do you know, N7? I have no idea, the android said. A legion of lost lochars. Ella stopped speaking before adding, That's a pinprick compared to how many must be in that ship. What did Naga Gobo say? I asked. The lochars don't use the dreadnoughts in fleet actions, but in exploratory adventures. That seems backward to me. They should use those things in battle and send smaller ships out as scouts. There is logic to your words, N7 said. That implies a mystery concerning the dreadnoughts. One of the engineers entered the control room with a tray of steaming cups of coffee. He put one in a holder near N7's panel. The android sipped. He liked his coffee scalding hot and black. It always seemed to me as if N7 drank oil. He was an android, not a human. Why did I have to keep telling myself that? Okay, I said. We've taken care of the first threat. We don't have to worry about the Starkians anymore. Now we have to figure a way to deflect the Dreadnought. There's no way our freighters can beat Indomitable to the sun. Not unless the Tigers begin breaking. We can do nothing to deflect the Dreadnought, N7 said. I don't accept that, I said. You would have surprised me if you did. N7 said, finishing his coffee, handing the cup back to the engineer and taking another. I am curious what you suggest we do. We do not possess any T-missiles this time to invade within the targeted vessel. Maybe we don't need T-missiles, Rollo said. Let's pack the assault boats and follow the battle jumper as it rams the dreadnought. Whoosh, we fly inside and take control. Ella laughed sourly. We have approximately 150 assault troopers left. Can that number defeat tens of millions of legionaries? No, I said. At this point, all we have left is our honeyed tongues. We have to talk our way out of trouble. The Lohars strike me as creatures of action, Ella said. I clapped my hands together and pointed at her. Not only are they creatures of actions, but they appear to admire honor and courage. Rollo, tell the engine techs to get ready for propulsion. What are you planning? N7 asked. Do any of you happen to know the story of David and Goliath? I asked. I received blank looks of incomprehension. It's in the Old Testament, I said. A giant named Goliath from an army of Philistines threatened the ancient Israelites. He was like a Homeric champion, as in Achilles and Hector of Troy. Goliath boasted of his skills and demanded King Saul sent out a champion to face him. Whoever won the fight, the other side's host, would have to surrender. As you can imagine, the Israelites quaked in their sandals, dreading the idea of facing the warrior giant. Finally, a young shepherd boy around sixteen or seventeen showed up. He told the others God would help him defeat the giant. David used a sling and ran out to fight the hardened warrior. He asked for God's help and twirled the sling, hitting old Goliath in the forehead. The giant fell, and David used the champion's own sword against him, chopping off the Philistine's head. And that's what we're going to do to the Lohar Dreadnought? Rollo asked dubiously. No, I said. I don't see that we even have a slingstone of a chance fighting them. But we can show courage by charging the Lohars. What does that achieve? N7 asked. Not a whole heck of a lot, I admitted. But at least it will feel better than cowering in fear. I glanced around the control room. This is it, though. I'm not going to order you to your certain death. If you want to use an assault boat to go down to Earth and join Diana, that's your choice. Commander, 
and Seven said, The Lohar Admiral is calling. Do you want to speak with him? Of course, I said. Put him on. The same tiger as before regarded me. The same time lag of lip and sound gave the conversation a surreal feeling. You destroyed the Starkians, he said. They were my enemy. His yellow eyes seemed to glow. I have recordings of the Battle of Sigma Draconis. During my voyage here I have watched them. I know you, Commander Creed. I am aware of your bloodthirstiness toward my people. Do you think I might have a reason for that? I asked softly. I am uninterested in your reasons, he said. Here are my terms. You must leave the battle jumper, you and every one of your personnel. I do not care where the rest of your people go, but you must come to me. Go on, I said, feeling a knot tightening in my chest. Tell me the rest. I give the orders, he said. You are in no position to order me to speak. That's true to a point, I said. I do have one card I can still play. That is incorrect. You have nothing. I can destroy the battle jumper. Blow it up. His eyes widened. No, you must not do that. That was an interesting reaction. Admiral. High Lord Admiral, he said promptly. High Lord Admiral, I said. You haven't yet given me any reason why I should comply with your request. I give orders, not requests. I'm not under your orders. I don't fear your threats. That makes it a request. If you want the battle jumper, then I'm inclined to destroy it. If you do, he said, I will slay every human in the solar system. So what? I said. You're already going to do that. Incorrect, he said. My orders call for me to pick up every human here, not kill them. The knot in my chest twisted into something cold and hard. What kind of vile experiments did the Lohars wish to perform on the last humans? I had a feeling I would be doing everyone a favor by destroying the battle jumper. Better a dead man than a shrieking, tortured man soon to be dead. What is your reason for wanting to pick us up? I asked. I am not in the habit of explaining my actions to inferiors, he said. I was already tired of the arrogant admiral and found it impossible to control my every reaction. Well, you'd better start getting in the habit pretty quick, I told him. Otherwise, you're going to lose the battle jumper. You are obstinate and unreasonable. I do not understand why you wish to die. I don't wish it, I said. But I'd rather pass honorably in battle than face torture at Lohar hands. He stiffened, and his left hand paw opened and closed spasmodically. I noticed the tips of his claws appearing and disappearing. Have a care, earthling, how you address a high lord admiral of the pride. Why did aliens always act so strangely? I'm curious, I said. Could you explain what I just said that made you so angry? He glared at me, finally saying, We of the pride do not torture anyone. We slay honorably in battle and treat our prisoners with dignity. However, you will not be prisoners. What will we be? Detainees for a time, he said. And then? He seemed to become uncomfortable. It will depend on several factors. So you're saying you want me to come to you? Is it to discuss terms? Indomitable will soon be in orbit around Earth, he said. "'ignoring my question. "'Then you can come to us. 
then you must come to us and formally surrender. I'm supposed to surrender to the Lohar who personally murdered my father? A voice broke in on his side, and a second Lohar, quite unlike the Admiral, appeared. This tiger was taller and thinner, with a different type of uniform. He spoke rapidly with hisses and snarls. The Admiral raised a heavy paw as if to strike the new Lohar. That one stiffened, as if waiting for the blow to fall. Finally, the Admiral lowered his arm. With a stiff bow, the taller Lohar retreated out of view. The Admiral cleared his throat and turned to me. I am. He snarled quietly, as if to himself. Then he looked up, glaring into the screen. The alien contact officer has informed me of, uh, forgotten protocol. You will not officially surrender. Instead, we will— The admiral snarled with obvious frustrations. He pointed a clawed finger at me. You will board my ship, Commander Creed, or your humans will perish. If you are so foolish as to reject this offer— No, I said. I'm going to come. If this is a setup, it's well done on your part. Still, getting to see you squirm, in person no less, I wouldn't miss that for the world. The Admiral glared a moment longer before the connection ended. Are you crazy? Rollo asked. You plan to go on to his dreadnought? There's something weird going on, I said. And we really don't have many options left. Besides, I want to understand these tigers. They've killed our planet, but we've beaten them in battle each time as assault troopers. The alien contact officer interests me. And I'm curious about the dreadnought being an exploratory vessel. What about us? Ella asked. What should we do? That was a good question. I think the rest of you should head down to Earth, I said. Join Diana and her freighter. If this is a trick, and the Lohars mean to torture us, better that just one go than all of us. I will join you, N7 said. Me too, Rollo said. I'm not going to let you do this alone. I didn't the first time. Why would I now? I will also come with you, Ella said. I might see connections you would miss. While I appreciate the offers, I said, this time I'm going alone. That's madness, Rollo said. You need at least one of us with you. Two are better than one. He had a point. One man by himself usually didn't act as bravely as two men would. The reason was easy to understand. If someone you knew watched your actions, it helped stiffen your spine. As a youngster in prison, I wanted to be like a leopard or hawk, a creature who stalked through life independent and alone. I since came to understand that man was social. He needed the company of his own kind. He wasn't a leopard, and seldom did well if completely isolated. You have a point, I told Rollo. And Seven, you will come with me. I want you others to stick together somewhere on Earth. If you don't hear from me after several hours, then take the assault boats and go as deep as you can in an ocean or lake. Maybe a few of you can survive Lohar treachery. I don't see how playing submarine will help us if the Lohars kill everyone else, Rollo said. I'll tell you how, I said. You wait a week, lift off afterward, take the assault boats through a jump point, and go to a planet with starships. Board one, capture it, and then, I don't know, give the aliens hell for as long as you can. Rollo snorted, shaking his head. You are the most bloodthirsty, one-tracked man I know, Ella said. Before I could reply, Rollo asked, Are you sure about this creed? No. Despite what Ella believes, I'm as uncertain as can be. This mess. I squinted at the screen, watching the approaching monstrosity from the stars. 
Ever since they hit Earth the first time, I've wanted to get on to the Lohar killer. This is my chance. If I'm lucky, who knows? Maybe I can plant my bowie knife in that big admiral bastard's chest. Give him my piece of tin, so to speak, as his reward for what he did to my dad. There was more arguing, and it took another thirteen hours before Indomitable reached Earth. But I was crossing my Rubicon. For those of you who slept through history class, the Rubicon was the name of the stream Julius Caesar splashed across before starting the Roman Civil War. The senators had told him to stay out of Italy with his legions, but J.C. didn't like to listen to others. He waded across and had his run of victories against Pompey and company. In the end, though, all the war gained Caesar was a legend and a chest full of senatorial daggers as he choked to death on his own blood. I had no idea what crossing my Rubicon would win me. I just hoped I could be courageous no matter what happened next. Chapter 10 Everyone left the battle jumper, but not before the engineers rigged the vessel to self-destruct. I gave Ella the trigger device. It looked like an old gym locker, the kind you dialed back and forth. Her trigger had a four-sequence number. The self-destruct would give her, and maybe me, one last bargaining chip with the Admiral. The others rode two assault boats and various air cars down to Earth. I watched them fade into the distance, with Central Africa in the background. The last I saw were dark pinpricks against the most beautiful planet in the galaxy. Maybe Diana could use them. Provided the Lohars told the truth and weren't here on an extermination mission. Yet, if the aliens told the truth and the Starkians really had been working for them, why had the android assassin first shot me with toxins? I sat up in my control chair. I took the last assault boat out to meet the Lohars. Most of the androids had used lasers against us. Against me, the plastic killer had used drug-laced needles. Did that mean the android hadn't been trying to kill me, but capture my butt? Naga Gobo said he was supposed to bring me back as a captive. Why would the Lohars want me that badly? Did they see me as a war criminal and want me before a people's tribunal? If that were true, why bring a dreadnought to capture me? Surely the vessel had vast operating costs. What were the Lohars looking or exploring for, using something so massive? Was the sought item so dangerous that they actually needed a ship of such size? There, N7 said. Dreadnought Indomitable. The asteroid-sized ship must have dumped gravity waves. On our screen, I could see it break into a stationary position, but I didn't see a long exhaust tail. So how was it doing that? While nervously chewing on a lip, I engaged the boat's thrusters. Both N7 and I were pressed against our padded chairs as the assault boat headed toward destiny. Our N-series android didn't wear symbiotic armor. The stuff didn't take to his kind. He wore cyber armor, the mechanical skin molded to fit him. Our helmets were nearly identical, though. I think Rollo's right, I said. This is the craziest thing I've ever done. Negative, N7 said. That would be using the teleportation bomb to appear inside the battle jumper. I still find myself amazed we are alive. Perhaps that is the reason the Admiral wishes to capture you. The Lohars are a conservative military race. You used one of their weapons in an interesting way. Learning about the new tactic might be worth the price of bringing Indomitable to Earth. That's an interesting thought, but I don't think that's it. Neither do I, N7 admitted. Their actions are most perplexing. It nearly took a half hour for us to journey to them. Finally, we slowed our velocity, and soon the monstrous dreadnought came in visual range. I swallowed hard, staring out the viewing port. Indomitable brought back painful memories. It looked too much as it had a year ago in orbit around our world. 
How wise was it to head in to meet the arrogant dick of a tiger admiral who had blown away my dad and my world? Interesting, N7 said as he leaned forward in examination. He didn't have to point. I saw it. The dreadnought had taken damage, heavy pounding. The part we'd seen through our teleoptics hadn't shown the shredded side of the vessel. Now, as we brought the assault boat in for a landing, I saw jagged rents in the armored hull. It took a moment for that to register. The rents were kilometers in width, and sometimes places glowed in there and then quit glowing. Have they been in a battle? I asked. It would appear so, N7 said. Did someone manage to get nuclear warheads close enough? I do not know, he said. Wonder what the other guy looks like, I asked. A prudent question, N7 said. Yes, that would reveal much if we knew. I couldn't help but grin. Seeing the giant vessel damaged felt good. Someone had hurt them, at least. I would have liked to shake their hand or tentacle and buy them a beer. Alohar hailed us on the comm unit. He appeared to be a functionary to guide us to the correct portal. Perhaps I should pilot us in, N7 said. You have much on your mind and need to maintain a high energy level. That sounded like good advice, so I took it. I'd thought about wearing my symbiotic armor to the historic meeting. If the Tigers planned to capture me, I'd fight to the death. But if that were true, the capturing, why was I coming into the den of lions in the first place? No, I was playing a hunch, I suppose. I had come to believe the Tigers kept their word. That meant the second skin wouldn't make any difference, so why bother with it? The truly monstrous size of the dreadnought became more apparent as we approached. It began blotting out more and more stars, becoming like a portable world to us. How many decades of construction had gone into making the thing? How many Lohars lived aboard it? Hundreds of thousands of mechs and techs must be employed, keeping it running. No wonder a high lord admiral commanded the dreadnought. This doesn't make sense, I told N7. Why build something so big? I don't think it's a military reason. Instead of putting all of one's eggs in a single basket, a thousand battle jumpers would be wiser. Agreed, N7 said. Perhaps it relates to its primary function, that of an exploratory vessel. I don't buy that either. The whole thing is weird, if you ask me. I shrugged. Maybe the Lohars are into impressive stuff, and somewhere down the line they got carried away. You saw the High Lord Admiral's uniform. Ha! <laughs> Listen to the title. Maybe they think bigger is always better. So after giving themselves long titles, they went and built the granddaddy of all starships. N7 concentrated on piloting. Not that he needed to. There was so much space. We passed through a monstrous portal with blinking green lights shooting along the sides of the oval opening. It reminded me of Christmas Tree Lane back in my old hometown. The vast entrance made our salt boat seem like a fly buzzing into a house. Soon we flew over a hangar deck kilometers upon kilometers in circumference. If that weren't enough of a kick... On the deck below, parked wingtip to wingtip, were thousands upon tens of thousands of alien fighters. They were bulky, with stubby, triangular wings. I wouldn't have been surprised if someone informed me that I looked at more aircraft than the combined total of the U.S., China, Russia, Israel, heck, the entire Earth's air forces in any given year. Or what Earth used to have. Alohar spoke to N7 over the comm, guiding us over the hordes of assault craft. Finally, I saw a neon-red outline down there, a place for us to park beside all the fighters. We went down and landed with a clang, 
and Seven jostling us in our seats. I was too wound up to ask him why he'd made such a poor landing. Could androids be nervous? And Seven twisted in his seat, looking up. I did, too, noticing he watched a video feed of what went on behind us. Oh. He watched the outer portal slowly slid shut. Is that how flies felt when I'd closed the door to my house as a kid? What do we do now? I asked. The answer came in the form of military hovercraft, twenty of them. They raced across the hangar deck with turret cannons aimed at our assault boat. Trusting tigers, aren't they? I said. We suited up in regular vacuum gear and exited the boat. Goodbye, Jelt Tech, and hello, Lohar. I hoped the tigers were honorable. I admit it was difficult walking toward what could be my last hours before horrendous alien torture. At least one hundred battle-armored Lohars filed off the hovers. The vehicles were bigger than any Earth tank, more like a Coast Guard patrol boat in size. The soldiers or legionaries marched in unison and carried laser rifles. They created a lane for us to walk down, with legionaries on either side of us. I felt like Moses walking through the parted waters of the Red Sea. The tigers towered over me as if each one was an NBA superstar. I noticed a range of Lohar sizes, starting with seven feet and going up to eight. Finally, N7 and I reached a ramp leading into a hover. With more than a little trepidation, I climbed the ramp. Would I regret this for the rest of my short life? Why did they want me, anyway? I wasn't anything special. Just one angry Earther willing to take a wild chance now and again. I refrained from muttering a radio remark to N7. He likely wouldn't understand it anyway. He had Ella's disease, simian curiosity about just about everything. I imagine our android loved every minute of this, drinking in the details. That was one of the reasons I brought N7 with me. He had a photographic memory, storing the images. We entered a narrow chamber with seats. Five armored tigers followed us, squeezing through the hatch in their armor. We all sat down and strapped in. I squirmed as the hover engine revved, and then we were moving. It took an hour, if you can believe that. No tiger talked to us during the entire time. We drove, walked down kilometers of corridors, and rode several different lifts. Forget about the feeling of moving through a city. This felt as if we moved through countryside and passed through several cities. Finally, the Lohar escorts brought us to our destination, stopping before an elephant-sized hatch. Within the massive door was a smaller man-sized portal. It slid up, and N7 and I walked toward a lone tiger, a thin and recognizable one. Instead of armor, he wore a black uniform with silver trim. I was grateful to see we approached the alien contact officer that had talked to the High Lord Admiral on the screen before. The portal slid shut behind us, leaving us alone with the Lohar. I take that back. The room was big the size and volume of a football stadium at least. Along the walls in layered tiers, one row above the other, sat hundreds of tiger technicians at their stations. Each of them monitored something, constantly adjusting and twisting dials. You heard right. Dials. Just like an old 1950s science fiction movie. I looked around. So did N7. I spied various antennas on the ceiling. One dish twisted up there until it aimed at me. The massive room lacked any other furniture, just lots of open space and deck plates. Okay, I said. What's going on? Are we zoo specimens or guests of the Lohars? You are Commander Creed? the alien contact officer asked. I noticed he didn't use a translator, but spoke tiger-accented English. That was interesting. 
There wasn't any time lag between his moving lips and the sound. Yes, I'm Commander Creed, I said. I admit that the approach to the giant vessel, the interior journey, and my predicament had cowed me. I wasn't feeling as aggressive as normal, and decided on a more cautious approach. First, clearing my throat, I asked, Is it against Lohar Protocol if I ask you what your name is? More of the antenna dishes on the ceiling swiveled toward me. And although we were too far away from them to know for certain, it seemed as if some of the monitoring tigers and the tears moved their hands and arms more rapidly. I am Dr. Shant, the tiger told me. Among my various duties, I am the chief xenopsychologist aboard Indomitable. Dr. Sant was the first Lohar I'd seen who stooped a bit at the shoulders. He looked thinner than the legionaries I'd slain in battle. He had white in his facial fur, and the eyes were a faded yellow. His uniform was a silver and black, as I've said, with orange chevrons on the sleeves. He lacked a blaster on his belt, although he had what looked like an old telephone receiver hooked there. He also wore a ring, a gaudy, plastic-looking thing a little girl might have bought in a big bubblegum dispenser. The High Lord Admiral said you were the alien contact officer, I said. I hold several titles, Sant said, and to my ear he spoke with pride. I am the most learned Lohar aboard ship, and hold several... Hmm... I believe you would call them diplomas. I found his vanity odd, and it struck a funny bone with me. Imagine the old-time alien aliens and their silver saucers who picked up people and ran tests on them. Imagine if the first words they said were, I am a pointy-headed university professor who lives in an ivory tower, and if he said that proudly. I realized I didn't know enough to make judgments about the Lohars. Still, Sant's words helped shake me out of my depression. They hadn't beaten me yet, even if I stood inside the belly of the whale. You've been to school a long time, have you? I asked. Sant leaned a little closer as I spoke, as if he needed to in order to hear my words. He was over seven feet tall, making the movement ominous. Then he smiled, showing fang-like teeth the kind vampires have in the movies. Yes, he said. I have studied longer than any aboard Indomitable. Despite my many duties, I am also taking a correspondence course from Regal Theology Cathedral. You're a religious man? I asked. He unhooked the old telephone receiver from his belt, clicked a button in the center, and put the phone against his right ear. He spoke quietly and then listened. I see, Sant told me as he hooked the receiver back onto his belt. You're asking if I believe in supernatural phenomenon. Not exactly, I said. What do they teach at Regal Theology Cathedral? Higher criticism concerning the Creator and various alien holy books he said promptly. That's all very interesting. Yes, I think so, too, Sant said. It is good we have a similar reference point. That will help us considerably. The odd, funny feeling departed. I was a fool if I thought Sant was amusing. These creatures had practically annihilated us. I needed to get my head in the game. Dr. Sand was an alien in form, feeling, and thought. An entire football stadium of Lohars was absorbed with the task of monitoring me. Why go to such lengths if they were simply going to kill me? Are you studying us? I asked. Are they studying us? Yes, Sand said. That is correct. I take it you've never met a human in person before, I asked. No, no, I've met several. Are they aboard your ship? 
I am afraid the High Lord Admiral did not permit that. The Admiral had them killed? I asked, with an edge returning to my voice. Yes, that's right. You are quite perceptive, which you might be interested to know I predicted would be the case. I refrained from grabbing my buoy and attacking the smug tiger. Other than the knife, I had no other weapons with me besides my fists and wits. I'd expected them to notice a gun, which is why I'd left mine behind. The receiver at his belt made a loud hum. Sant picked it up and listened. His eyes latched onto me as he did. Warily, he hooked the receiver onto his belt and took several steps back. I would like to warn you, Commander Creed, that several sharpshooters even now aim at your chest. If you make any sudden moves at me, you shall die. That would be most unfortunate. So I suggest you contain your anger. I get it, I said. Your monitors just saw an emotional spike and called to warn you. Yeah, you should know that I get unhappy hearing about Lohar's murdering more people. It makes my blood pressure rise. The receiver gave off its tones once more, but Dr. Sant ignored it. Finally, he turned toward one section of wall and waved his right arm. The tones stopped. I perceive your outrage, Sant said, turning back to me. From your perspective, I understand that you believe you are being reasonable. No, I know I'm being reasonable and hating the fact that Lohar's murdered humanity. Commander Creed. Just Creed will do, I said. That brought the doctor up short. He appeared puzzled. Are you not the commander? I am. Then why would you prefer me to call you Bear? What? I asked. Bear, N7 said. The Lohars are a formal race. They enjoy their titles and prerogatives. He cannot understand why you want him to call you your Bear name. It would be like you stripping and walking around naked. Dr. Sant nodded. Clever. Clever, you are a clever beast. Excuse me, he said as I began to bristle. I realize you are not beasts. You are people, albeit hopelessly mired in a primitive stage. So I had to go through this again. Okay, I'd use their arrogance against them just as I once had against cloth. Why do you think I'm so clever? I asked. I've had you brought here for study, Sant said. I mean this chamber, of course. Yet even as I study you, you study us, having brought a portable analyzer with you. Wait a minute, I said. Do you mean N7? Yes, of course. N7 is my friend. He's not just an analyzer. Dr. Sant glanced sharply at N7. It is a machine. With a bio-brain, I added, and with enough upgrades to have changed him. He is still a manufactured product, Sant said. He was never born. I didn't want them taking N7 away and dismantling him. If they called him a machine, they might not feel honor-bound toward him. Let me say it again, I told Sant. N7 is my friend, a friend to the human race. Dr. Sant squirmed uncomfortably. Commander Creed, let us reason this through. I held up my hand. Why do you care what I believe about him? What difference does that make to you? Sant twitched his whiskers and took a step closer to us. He lowered his voice as he said, You mustn't say such things in the High Lord Admiral's presence. To grant a machine sentient being is a primitive's response or the response of someone hopelessly superstitious. 
neither of those will persuade the High Lord Admiral to commit to the experiment. What experiment? I asked. Allow us to take one step at a time, Commander. Look, I said. If you guys dismantle N7, I'll take it as if you've murdered my brother. Please, Commander, contain your emotionalism and primitivism. Neither will help me nor help you or your race in this grave situation. Doc, you're confusing the crap out of me. Yes, that would appear to be a natural problem with our situation. Still, the Oracle has spoken. The High Lord Admiral wants to believe, but it isn't in his nature to submit to such indignities. I have had an extremely difficult time convincing him of the seriousness of the situation. You must aid me, not fight me. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. Please do not call the machine your friend. It will hinder, not help, and it is extremely disconcerting to me personally. I glanced at N7. The android pretended not to notice the scrutiny as he stared straight ahead. It made his features immobile, as only a construct could do. For that moment, his face seemed to have the texture of a plastic Halloween mask. An eerie thing. He has no soul, Sant explained. You realize that, do you not? Why don't we forget about it, I asked. You leave him alone, and I won't upset you with my beliefs. Dr. Sant began to pace back and forth. I had no idea this was going to prove so difficult. The High Lord Admiral was right in many regards about your race, about you. Yet we cannot ignore the Oracle. If we are to learn the secret of the Jelk... What did you say? I asked. This is about the Jelk? Dr. Sant regarded me. It's too early to go down that route. We must know more about you first. I massaged my forehead. What does the High Lord Admiral plan to do with the freighters? I asked. Sant stared at me, and it appeared as if he was on the knife edge of a difficult decision. Do you realize our quadrant of the spiral arm is in a fight to the death against the Jelk? I don't know much about that, Doc. He stiffened. I am Dr. Sant. Do not demean my rank with your primitive informality. I cannot abide it, and the High Lord Admiral... Sant shook his head. Sure, Doctor. I can see you're... Trying to understand us. We're on the same side, you and me. I didn't believe that, but he seemed more disposed toward humans than any other tiger. I don't know much about quadrant politics. Your admiral bombed us into oblivion and the Jelk offered the last human survival if we fought for them as assault troopers. What else could I have done? The honorable thing, Sant said. You could have proudly denied his insufferable offer and gone into oblivion with your human dignity intact. We tried to save you the ignobility of Jelk slavery. They did that by killing nearly everyone on Earth? Thanks a lot, I said sarcastically. Sant bowed at the waist. You are welcome, of course. I hadn't realized some of you humans understood the situation. I should have realized you of all people would know. No, you don't get it, I said. That was sarcasm just now. You... N7 laid a hand on my arm and shook his head. He doesn't understand about sarcasm. Lohars are all but devoid of humor. Dr. Sant hissed and he stared at me expectantly. N7 let go of my arm. What do you have to say now? Sant asked triumphantly. About what? I asked. The machine touched you and dared to admonish you in front of others. 
Do you wish it destroyed? I will grant you this boon as a matter of personal honor. It took me several seconds. I finally looked up at the ceiling full of antennas. The tigers were even more alien than I'd first realized. They thought much differently about many things. Maybe it was time to change tactics, to begin playing the game their way. I was in a fight, a battle of wits. Dr. Sant and his High Lord Admiral wanted to use me somehow. I wonder what the Oracle had told them. I had to use the Lohars if humanity was going to get out of this mess. I didn't know the tigers well, but after these brief words I had a clue as to the right way to act. Straightening my uniform, I spoke sternly. Listen to me well, Dr. Sant. I am Commander Creed, the leader of the last humans. I don't need Lohars taking care of my honor. I will address the android my own way and in my own time. Of course, of course, Sant said. I apologize. I did not mean any disrespect. I nodded stiffly. I take you at your word, Dr. Sant. The matter is forgotten. The tiger brought his left paw hand near his face and let needle-sharp claws appear from the tips, just as a real lion or tiger could do. Delicately, Sant scratched under his chin. It struck me as something a man might do in rubbing his jaw or scratching the back of his head. You give me hope, Commander Creed. I hadn't realized. Well, never mind. It probably wouldn't make much sense to you. Perhaps some of you, warriors such as yourself at least, can work with us. The others we tested. I could feel N7 watching me. The android did so for good reason. I hated the idea of Lohar's testing humans. Sometimes, though, one had to swallow his pride. Sometimes one had to go Starkian and get sneaky. I decided that as long as I was in Indomitable, I would act with tiger formality. I had to remember they were inordinately religious, too. Did the two go hand in hand? I didn't know. Here is how we will proceed, Sant said. I suggest we familiarize ourselves with each other. I will... Hmm coach you on the correct way to address the High Lord Admiral. He is ultra-conservative in bearing and dignity. He is a lohar of immense gravity. It would be unwise to use any of your informality and primitivism with him. Can we agree to that? I'd like to know your objective, Dr. Sant. Why has the lohar pride attacked Earth one minute and now believe we'll help you the next? The reasons are excellent, as I'm sure you'll agree once I tell you. So tell me. Dr. Sant might have. Before he had the opportunity, the door slid up. And Seven and I turned around. Tigers in elaborate dress uniforms and bearing Baroque rifles marched into the chamber. Like World War I-style German soldiers, they had single spikes on their helmets. It made them seem nine feet tall. Then I realized these tigers were bigger than the ordinary ones. Indomitable's Imperial Guard, Sant whispered. You must be on your best behavior, I implore you. I wondered why that should be. The guards marched into the room, about thirty of them. They marched in perfect unison parting around us until they encircled N7, Dr. Sant, and me. Only then did the High Lord Admiral make his appearance. The tiger swaggered into the football-sized chamber. He wore his fancy braid and carried an ornate baton like a sixteenth-century marshal used to hold when artists painted his portrait. The Admiral halted, studying me as one might a trained pit bull. Dr. Sant spoke in a ringing voice. Bow low, Commander Creed. 
for you are in the presence of Prince Venturi of Orange Tamaika, the High Lord Admiral of Dreadnought Indomitable, an explorer first class, and a soldier of the combat school of Shakarn. Chapter 11 I didn't bow. I didn't even incline my head. This bastard had ordered the death of my father and the earth. I'd sooner stick my buoy in his chest than grant him the slightest honor. My apologies, Prince, Sand said. I haven't yet had time to teach him the correct protocol. Time isn't the issue, Venturi said in a gruff voice. Besides, he is a killer and a savage. Protocol means nothing to such as him. Perhaps... Venturi raised a heavy paw. Lohar fingers were blunter than ours were, and shorter. Well, not in actual size, but in proportion to their larger bodies. He had three different fleshy pads on each finger, without hair. Like a human finger, there were three parts or joints. The doctor fell silent. I am well able to defend my honor, Admiral Venturi said. If I desire, my guard shall beat the offender to death. Nothing, in fact, would please me more, except obeying the suggestions of the Oracle. He regarded me. It is the only thing keeping you alive. I waited, wondering what this Oracle had said that would keep the tiger from killing me. It appears to understand patience, Venturi said. That is a useful trait in a killer. Why don't you make your pitch, I said. Now see here, Commander Creed, Sant said. You cannot speak to a prince of the Orange Tamaika. We will make allowances today, Venturi told the doctor. The sands of fate run against us. We have no more time for useless arguing. He made growling noises before regarding me. I find you offensive, human. Your stench, your arrogance, and your buffoonery all conspire to enrage me against you. For your disobedience of my order concerning the Starkians, I should rend you limb from limb. I eased forward onto my toes, ready to draw my buoy and attack. If it hadn't been for the defenseless freighters racing to the sun in an attempt to escape, I eased back onto my heels, waiting. Instead of gratifying my desires, Venturi said, I will show you a marvel that confounds League scientists, holy adepts, and emperors alike. It is a terror from beyond time and I'm gambling your primitive mind has the wit to understand its significance. The prince, or admiral, aimed his baton at the ceiling and pressed several buttons on the end. A half of the chamber darkened. Within the gloom, a hollow image of the Altair object appeared against the background of stars. The forerunner artifact was torus or donut-shaped, as I've said before, with a black hole in the center. I'd been told the first ones had constructed it ages ago. An asteroid maze orbited the object. On the circling rocks, the Lohar Fifth Legion waited. To them, this was holy space. The artifact venerated in the name of the Creator. I don't know where Venturi got the footage, but he replayed the combined Starkian android assault trooper attack against it. He used speeded images slowing a few times to show a particularly savage conflict. Starkian ships expelled masses of assault boats, which closed against the maze and disgorged sled-riding troopers. All the while, Lohar lasers beamed from asteroid domes, destroying attackers. The footage brought back bitter memories. Thousands of assault troopers perished that day, although Lohar legionaries died too. Finally, legionaries retreated toward the center forerunner artifact. Then it happened again. 
The object brightened like something from heaven before growing fainter and fainter. Finally it disappeared, taking a number of Fifth Legion soldiers with it. You witnessed a miracle, Venturi said in a rough voice. The Jilt Corporation desired the artifact and went to great lengths to acquire it. Instead of allowing that to happen, it would appear that the Creator summoned the artifact home. Those who know about the sacrilegious assault believed such an event occurred, or the majority did anyway. What else could have caused a miracle? The Forerunner artifact had been troubling me for some time. What did it do? Why did the Jade League venerate it as something from the Creator if the First Ones had built it? And finally, why did the Jilk want it? I blurted. Huh? Venturi asked, tearing his gaze from the hollow image to scowl at me. He does not understand his breach of protocol, Lord, Sant said. He deserves a beating. Cease, Venturi said. Having him in my presence is belittling enough. Yet, if I can stomach his nearness, I can endure his apish chatter, too, I suppose. He thirsts for knowledge, which is a sign of intelligence after all. We can be grateful for that. Yes, Lord, Sant said. Here I am, Admiral, Doctor. I am not on homeworld at court. It is against the detot of Purple Tamika for you to address me as nobility in this place. Yes, Admiral, Sant said. I am abashed at my conduct. Cease, Venturi said. We have no time for strict formality. Dr. Sant bowed his head. Venturi regarded me. As to your question, I believe the artifact has spawning implications. What does that mean? I asked. Indeed, Venturi said. Hmm. I spoke with Naga Gobo before he perished. I found the encounter demeaning but useful. You might be interested to learn that the Starkian knew you had turned a Jelk incorporeal. You know a lot, I said. The Lohars and then the Jade League have warred against the Corporation for generations. Yes, we know the basic nature of the Jelk. In essence, they are energy beings able to house themselves in bodies of flesh and blood. The holy adepts believe Jelk crave sensations. Venturi studied me. I do not know if you have the capacity to understand this, but the Jelk did not originate in our universe, but came from outside it. What? I asked. Do you mean they originated in a parallel universe? N7 asked. Venturi's head whipped about as he stared at N7. The tiger growled low in his throat and hunched his shoulders as claws appeared at the end of his fingertips. Keep your machine silent or I will destroy it. N7, I said. The android nodded his understanding. It took Venturi a few moments to settle himself. He tugged at the cuffs of his sleeves, brushing the orange chevron sewn there. Finally, he resumed talking. If you can understand the concept of parallel universes, yes, that will be sufficient. Jelk are others in the worst sense of the word. How they crossed from one space-time continuum to another we do not know. It happened eons ago. Certain theorists claim the Jelk visited the early worlds, astounded at the life-forms there, bewildered at flesh, blood, and bones. Through a process of trial and error, the energy creatures built bodies for themselves, a particle at a time. Some holy adepts think the Jelk first possessed or inhabited our ancestors' bodies— and only afterward desired their own forms. 
In any case, in order to reproduce, a jelk splits his energy in a similar manner as a single-celled organism, or an amoeba. However, they cannot do so under normal conditions in our universe. They must stimulate whatever their space-time continuum did that allowed them to procreate. Our most learned scientists believe Jelk need powerful constructs like the artifact in order to render itself into two. As far as we know, these two spawns are granted the newness of vigor and desire of youth, but they maintain the knowledge of the older, single being. How does the Forerunner artifact help them split? I asked. Firstly, our scientists do not know the Jelk must have the artifact for this. It is a theory, albeit the best we have to date. That is one of the primary reasons the Jade League guards each artifact with military power. We must unite in order to keep the Jelk from growing more numerous. I can see that, I said. After watching Cloth change and burn his way free of the battle jumper, I'd agree they're as alien as can be. If the artifact can help him spawn, and Cloth went for it, that would imply he needs to split, or has a growing desire for it. Yes, of course, Venturi said. It is an obvious deduction. So do you know where the artifact went after it disappeared? I asked. Venturi stared up at the ceiling. Dr. Sant cleared his throat before addressing me. It would be more seemly if you waited for the prince to give you this information, to grill him as if he were a recruit. Sant shook his head. Raising the baton, Venturi clicked more buttons. The asteroid ship wreckage of the Forerunner battle, Starkian vessels, and the entire Altair system faded into darkness. Slowly, a fuzzy world hollow image appeared in its place. The planet had a metallic sheen and jigsaw puzzle lines, as if someone had bolted it together. Several glowing, meteor-sized shimmers circled the spheroid. We do not know if the Jelk pre-planned the event. Venturi said in a softer voice than before. Imperial scientists and holy adepts have multiple opinions on the subject. The truth is we do not know how this happened. I wanted to ask, no what? The information pouring out of the tiger was too interesting, though, for me to want to jeopardize it. I wish Ella could have been here to see this and give me her opinion. Venturi lowered the baton and stared at the fuzzy, metallic-looking spheroid. Its fuzziness was in the sense of bad TV reception, as in the days of Rabbit Ear's antenna. As I've said before, Venturi told me, I am going to gamble on your intelligence. Why otherwise would the Oracle have spoken about you? It is a mystery, one among many, I might add. He cleared his throat. The Jade League has been on the defensive against the Jilt Corporation for many generations. We have fought them to a standstill in places. In others, in the past few years, we have gone on to the offensive. Admiral Venturi, I said. During my time in Corporation service, I heard otherwise. Cloth told us the Jelk hadn't taken the offensive for generations. I'm not surprised he lied to you, Venturi said. You were Jelk slaves, and they are masters of disinformation and misdirection. Now do not interrupt me again. It's too irritating and disrupts my concentration. He breathed heavily, and I noticed the honor guards watching me more closely. Finally, as he breathed normally again, Venturi began speaking in a low voice. There are those of us who believe we should attack the corporation vigorously. Among those, Orange Tamika has argued the hardest for hammering assaults, and we have filled the most command slots in the exploratory arm of Lohar Space Service. We captain the dreadnoughts, the few we have. 
They are the largest vessels in known space, and there is a reason for their size. We have the engines, the power plants, and space-tearing components that let us enter hyperspace. Venturi eyed me. Do you know what hyperspace is? I do not, I said. No doubt your machine could tell you, Venturi said. But I will do so. Hyperspace lies between the parallel universes. Some suggest that hyperspace is a parallel universe all its own. I do not accept that. Rather, in hyperspace, the separation between the universes weakens. The most knowledgeable concerning the Jelk believe they used hyperspace to reach our space-time continuum. Based on the theory, our dreadnoughts search for the rent in hyperspace so we can find the original Jelk homeworld. Once found and the homeworld studied, many adepts believe we will have the knowledge to destroy the Jelk forever. Are the Jelk devils? I asked. Is their parallel universe hell? They sure seem like demons. That is a quaint proposal, Dr. Sand said. And at this point in the discussion, also meaningless, Venturi said. The point I'm trying to make is that we have a working knowledge of hyperspace. The first ones were said to possess that understanding. After studying ancient holy texts of the First Ones, pious adepts first proposed hyperspace. The scientists told us that tampering with hyperspace would be dangerous, given it existed. If there were enough universes, whatever could exist would exist, and thus we shouldn't attempt to reach them at peril to ourselves. Okay, I thought. What does that mean in reality? I am of the opinion that your attack against the Forerunner artifact triggered a defense mechanism in it, Venturi said. It must have known you were Jelk slaves, although that is a supposition. I wanted to ask how a construct could know that, but refrained. Maybe I'd learn the answer by listening. Where did the artifact go? Venturi said. I believe you asked that. We might have never found out until too late, but fortunately Indomitable was in hyperspace at the time. Hyperspace. It is a strange and terrifying place. The laws of motion work differently there. It is nearly impossible to navigate in any meaningful manner. Can you imagine my amazement when my signals officer told me she was receiving Lohar distress calls? I ran to her side, hovering over her instruments as she replayed the signal. It seemed impossible. This was hyperspace, but the call grew in strength as we homed in on it. Finally, we realized the distress signal came from the Lohar Fifth Legion, the one guarding the Altair object. Venturi shook his head, and his eyes had a far-off look, as if he stared at a distant point in the past that only he could see. We increased velocity, and the signal became clearer. A centurion of Orange Tomica spoke to us. He told us about the sacrilegious assault in the Altair system and the artifacts vanishing. Several hundred legionaries survived the artifact's transfer and reappearance at its new location. The admiral growled and glanced at me. The centurion asked what you might have in his place, wondering if he'd been transported to hell for the sin of losing the battle. I told the centurion he'd come into hyperspace. He told me he saw no space at all but gleaming metal and incomprehensible machines. A raspy tongue appeared in the Admiral's mouth. It took us days of ship time to reach them. During the interval, the Legion's last adept used his holy book to decipher some of the planet's commands. The symbols were an ancient script that only the most studious adepts learn. I wanted to ask the Prince... What planet? 
but held my tongue. The implications of his words were clear, Venturi said. The surviving legionaries were in yet another construct of the first ones. This one, however... The admiral raised the baton and pointed at the fuzzy object. The aliens attacked before we could reach the portal planet. They used jamming equipment and almost cut our contact with the Centurion completely. We would never have found the hyperspace planet if contact had been cut too soon. The planet was and is the only one of its kind that I or anyone else I know has seen or heard of. As far as our garbled transmissions could make out, the Forerunner artifact from the Altair star system had appeared in the center of the planet you see up there. The Admiral paused. I heard the Centurion say the Altair object had fit into the construct as a hand fits into a gauntlet. It would seem by his words that the First Ones had constructed the Altair object as a key for the portal planet. The implications are terrifying. It means the First Ones must have built the planet, if that really is an entire world. We never got near enough to know precisely. To my eye, the planet looks metallic, like a construct through and through. And the Centurions said they were in the center of things, as one would be in the center of a world-spanning engine. You spoke about aliens, I said. They kept you from the planet? You swung around indomitable before docking your assault boat, Venturi said. You must have seen the damage. We did. It was heavy. Almost crippling damage, Venturi corrected. We voyaged close enough to take the video you see up there. Then the aliens attacked in unbelievable swarms. The craft darted with amazing speed, taking G-annihilating turns no Lohar could sustain. Ships three times the size of one of our fighters beamed a graviton ray, slicing through our shields and ripping hull armor. Indomitable barely fought free of the first wave. Then explosions occurred unexpectedly within our ship, the after-effects of graviton beams. The outer engines took hard hits, and the power cells drained one after another. Luckily, we had sufficient energy reserves to open a rip, escaping from hyperspace back into our own universe. The attempt to reach the planet cost me more than half my crew. That meant millions were dead. Millions. If the Admiral wanted me to feel sorry for him, I didn't. I was glad these aliens had torn the Lohars a new one. Strike one against the Earth Killers. Look how his eyes shine with hatred against us, Venturi told the doctor. These humans are thorough savages, made for war. I wonder at the Oracle's wisdom. We should destroy them and be done with it. My right hand strayed to my buoy. If he was going to order us dead, I'd take him with me. I would love to hear the end of the tale, Lord Prince. Sant said. Venturi didn't correct the doctor this time. The tiger prince looked wearily at the hollow image spheroid. If you would have known what your folly would unleash, I wonder if you would have been so quick to follow Jelk orders. Was he talking to me? I didn't have much choice at the time. Besides, I still didn't see what the hubbub was about, bub. So, a few aliens had graviton rays. Big deal, why should I care? Did Shaw Cloth know what would happen to the artifact? Venturi asked no one in particular. I cannot believe he did. No, he must have believed he could capture the Altair object. Then again, maybe his sexual drive to split into two overrode all precautions in him. Maybe he couldn't have stopped himself if he'd wanted. I do not know. The Prince Admiral clicked the baton once again. 
One of the glowing areas near the planet opened like a flower. Within it swirled a black void. Out of the void drifted vessels shaped like giant snowflakes. From the snowflakes rained particles drifting down onto the portal planet. You are witnessing the aliens. Cogs, Venturi said in a soft voice. Before you belabor me with your chatter, I will explain the cogs to you. My knowledge comes from the last transmission with the Centurion. Their adept had found amazing data banks over ten thousand years old. The rest of our knowledge comes from the Oracle. Have you heard of it before this? No, I said. The Oracle is the supreme Lohar marvel of all. Venturi said proudly. It is a product of the greatest adepts of the ages. A gift from the Creator, Dr. Sand said. Perhaps that is so, Venturi said. Its centerpiece also belonged to the First Ones. That is clear. A marvel of marvels, Sand whispered. Several of the honor guards made what I took to be religious gestures, much as a Catholic would have done making the sign of the cross. The Kargs are a devouring species even more rapacious than the Jelk, Venturi told me. They inhabit a much smaller universe than ours, with fewer planets per star. Those planets they have inhabited... When that became too little space, they demolished the planets and used the matter to create Dyson spheres around the various suns. They annihilated all other life forms but their own. They are xenophobic to an intense degree. It seems the first ones visited the small universe eons ago, barely escaping with their lives. The Kargs know about multiple universes, and it has driven them into a frothing rage to cross over and devour us. Given enough time, if the portal planet remains operative, they will come, with billions upon billions of starships, to conquer our galaxy and then our universe. Clearly the Jade League would never survive such mass and firepower. Maybe the Jelk would perish as well. Maybe the Jelk will escape and journey to a safer universe. I do not know. What I do know is that we must destroy the portal to the Karg universe, and that means returning to the planet in hyperspace. I stared at the fuzzy hollow image. So... Speak, Venturi said. This time I will allow you to ask me your questions. The time has finally come. But just to be clear, I said, I'm thinking that you're suggesting the Forerunner artifact powers the portal planet. Ah, Venturi said in a mocking manner. That was logically deduced, Savage. It also happens to be correct. Such the Centurion informed me. The Forerunner artifact is the key to opening the portals to other universes. The rest of the spheroid is the engine. The Oracle has decreed that we must remove the Forerunner artifact from the center of the constructed world. It is the one piece of irreplaceable equipment, the one thing the Kargs cannot duplicate. So, how big is the world, exactly? I asked. Slightly larger than your Earth, Venturi said, and with a bit more mass. And the Forerunner artifact is somewhere in the center of that? Not somewhere in the center, Venturi said, but in the exact center. Journey to the center of the metallic planet, I muttered. Okay, I'm not sure what you're expecting from me, but the answer seems easy enough. Take all your dreadnoughts, whatever other warcraft you can, into hyperspace and return there. Defeat the Karg fleet and annihilate the planet. That should close the portal and end of story. How much firepower would it take to destroy your Earth? 
Venturi asked. You've already destroyed it, I said. The nuclear warheads were less than pinpricks to the planet, Venturi said. The bio-terminator was meaningless. Not to billions of humans, I shouted. The guards aimed their rifles at me and seemed eager to fire. Put those down, Venturi snapped. The rifles smoothly returned to their sides, and the tiger guard stared straight ahead. You are failing to understand me, Venturi said. You humans lived on the surface of Earth. How many nuclear devices would it take to split the planet open and destroy the core? Oh, I said. I don't know. Notice the hollow image, Venturi said. Those craft coming through the rip in time and space are giant cog warships. The particles falling from them are titanic landers. It is likely that millions of Karg soldiers are already garrisoning the spheroid. Wait a minute, I said. I think I'm finally getting this. You lost millions of legionaries when the Kargs blasted your dreadnought. Now you need replacements. You mean for us to do your dirty work, don't you? Admiral Venturi growled with his facial fur bristling. You have a high opinion of your soldierly worth. We are the Lohars. We are the guardians of the holy objects. We will right this wrong you have started with the Altair system attack. Why did your oracle tell you to come to me? I asked. If you can take care of this, why are you here talking to me instead of getting ready to return to hyperspace? Have a care, human. Venturi warned. I don't think so, I said. Your oracle says you need us. Can you imagine the gall? You obliterated 99% of humanity. Now you want the last 1% to save your ass. That's rich. Vain primitive, Venturi said. Your attack into the Altair system started this. Don't you have any appreciation for what you've done? Not a whit, I said. We were doing well enough on Earth on our own. Then you Lohars showed up and nuked us. We did it in order to save you from the ignobility of Jelk slavery, Venturi said. Is that the party line? I asked. It doesn't impress me. Why didn't you bring some starships and dreadnoughts and help us defend our planet from the Jelk? You were not part of the Jade League. That's it? I asked. That's your excuse? So instead you murdered my father and... Please, Sant said. Accusations won't get us anywhere now. The Kargs are as dangerous to you, Commander Creed, as they are to us. I raised my eyebrows. Is that what you think? My planet smolders below as a radioactive wasteland you created. The last humans are hightailing it in crappy junk freighters. We're almost kaput as it is. Now you're crying because you might be in the same boat as us? <sighs> I don't care what happens to you. If we die, Venturi said, you die. You don't listen very well, Prince. We're already dead. The freighters still carry humans, Venturi said softly. They carry millions of your kind. You are not yet extinct, although you could be in short order. I stared at him. I got his point. No help from us, no more freighters for humanity. Let's get down to it, then, I said. What are you willing to offer me in order for us to do what, exactly, for you? I am offering you the opportunity to save your universe, Venturi said. I shook my head. You're going to have to give me something tangible. I am a prince of orange to mica. Our color is not ascendant. 
Maybe you'd better explain that, I said. Purple Tamika rules, Venturi said curtly. We are presently outcasts, awaiting our chance for glory. The colors are factions? I asked. She speaks so crudely, Venturi told Sant. He is a primitive, Sant replied. Yes, true enough. Are you finished slapping yourselves on the back? I asked. If you can't offer us anything concrete because you lack the power, maybe you should take me to Purple Tamika and I'll talk to them. Venturi stiffened and his slit pupils widened in what I assumed was outrage. My prince? Sant said. No, Venturi whispered. No, I have taken my last insult from this primitive. Remember the oracle, my prince, Sant said. We must bargain with them despite their vulgarisms. Prince Venturi remained motionless for several seconds. Finally, he said, His words are incredibly demeaning. I desire to rip him apart and put his head on a spike. Yeah, and I'm the savage, I said. Venturi roared louder than I'd ever be able to yell. It hurt my eardrums, and I felt my body tighten. Was that an ancient atavistic dread on my part? He exposed his fangs, and I could look down into the blackness of his throat. His bearing transformed with startling swiftness into something feral. With cat-like speed, he rushed me and swung his baton at my head. I'd already shaken off my dread, and I reacted like a trooper. Using the neurofibers in my muscles, I dodged the blow and grabbed the offending arm. He was big and heavy, and I felt the coordination in him. Just the same, using a combat move, I took the admiral down onto the deck plates. He grunted painfully. I drew my bowie knife, deciding to slash his throat. He might keep his heart in a different place than a human would. Creed, N7 shouted. Don't do it. The battle madness departed me as swiftly as it had come. I dropped the knife. It clattered on the deck. I released the admiral. Looking up, I saw the guards aiming their rifles at me. "'High Lord!' Sant said, rushing to the fallen admiral. "'No,' Venturi said, brushing aside the doctor's hands and standing on his own. He looked down at me. "'Impressive,' he said. "'I'd heard about your battle speed. "'It is not regular human reflexes, is it?' I shook my head. Stand, Venturi said. I did, wondering how he could become so calm so fast. He bent his head, growling to himself. Finally he regarded me, and the shine no longer radiated quite so powerfully from his eyes. You are a warrior race. An ancient project, I believe. What did that mean? I know about the neurofibers, Venturi said. No Lohar would have allowed such sacrilege to his body, nor would we don your filthy bio-suits, living tissues wrapping over our body like a cocoon. Our honor is too great. I bent down and retrieved my buoy. No one objected, so I sheathed it. Maybe I should have cut his throat after all. I was sick of his boasting. You are right in a few particulars, Venturi told me. We lost many shipboard legionaries in our brief contact with the Kargs. Those legionaries were elite soldiers among our best. But the problem goes deeper than that. Lohars find it difficult enough to operate in hyperspace. It would be even worse for our individual legionaries. Why don't you just say it? I asked. You want us to fight for you. 
See, it's not so hard. Venturi raised a heavy paw. Let me finish, I implore you. We do not have time to quarrel. You hate me, and I loathe you. That is clear enough. Sometimes, however, enemies join forces to defeat a worse evil. You can talk, I said, and I can listen. Agreeing is another matter. Of course, Venturi said. He turned away, and he studied his baton. Soon he pointed it at the ceiling. The fuzzy, hollow image faded. In its place appeared a sharp, metallic cutaway of a different spheroid. He hefted the baton before regarding me. This is a diagram, he said. We do not know what the portal planet contains. The Centurion suggested it had many fail-safes and guardians. Likely it also now possesses millions of Karg soldiers. I will take Indomitable to our great space dock for speeded repairs. Meanwhile, our leadership will summon the other two dreadnoughts. Once ready, the flotilla will return to hyperspace, with Indomitable leading the way. The plan is simple but desperate. We don't know how many Karg vessels will have reached the rip into our hyperspace. Whatever the number, the three dreadnoughts will fight their way to the planet. Then we will launch legionaries in a vast space assault. Venturi clicked a button. A simmering shield appeared, protecting, it would seem, the cutaway planet. The assault ships will have to travel slowly enough to slide through the defensive screen. If they have too high a velocity, the shield will stop them. Our ships will deposit ten million Lohar legionaries onto the surface. Their task will be to fight downward toward the center of the construct. Ten million? I asked. Is that what you said? That is the extent of our three dreadnoughts carrying capacity, along with the assault ships and fighter protection they will need. The Kargs will no doubt attempt to stop us. It may already be too late, but surely the Oracle would have said as much if that was so. Ten million, I said. I doubt ten million legionaries will be enough, Venturi said. In fact, by its words, the Oracle indicates it won't be. This will not be a classic assault, as perhaps you are envisioning. We already know that ten million is far too few for such an attack. We would need one hundred million to launch a full-scale attack and win our way down into the portal planet's center. So what kind of attack are we talking about, then? I asked. This will be a commando raid. I laughed. You're joking, right? Venturi's eyes glowed. I have told you once already, I do not kid or joke. Okay, okay. A commando raid with ten million legionaries. I doubt you've ever made a regular attack with so many soldiers. You are correct. We have not. But you want to call it a commando raid, huh? The ten million legionaries will not be making the raid, Venturi said. The Oracle intimates that they will not be skilled or hardy enough to reach the Forerunner artifact. For that, I said, you need us, right? Yes, Venturi said softly. Unconsciously, it seemed to me, he stroked the teal-colored metal pinned on his uniform. It glittered darkly after his touch. For that, we need one hundred thousand assault troopers with neurofibers and symbiotic suits. I stared at the bastard, and things began to click into place. That's why you want our captured Jelk battle jumper, I said. It has the neurofibers and surgery centers, and it has the genetically engineered bio suits. Yes, Venturi said. 
Do the symbiotic suits work better in hyperspace than powered combat armor? That is an intelligent question, Venturi said. And the answer is yes. How about that? I muttered. There's something I don't understand, then. Why did you unleash the androids against my ship? Why start out trying to kill us if you need us? Naga Gobo did that on his own volition, Venturi said. He did not do so at my orders. He did it as a Starkian, a double-dealing pirate. I wondered if I could believe that. Maybe it didn't matter anymore, if what the prince told me was true. One hundred thousand Earthers, I said. Supposing I agreed to this madness, it would take time to get that many people ready. At present, only one hundred and fifty of us are trained as troopers. I will aid you, of course, Venturi said. Even so, you would have two, perhaps three weeks. I laughed. That's insane. No, that is desperation. If we wait any longer, it will be too late. The Kargs have unimaginable numbers. We must destroy the portal planet before they move those numbers into position. I would think the opening has also caught them by surprise. Once we do all that, how do we escape from the portal planet? Venturi shook his head. This is a one-way mission. There will not be any escape for any of us. The Kargs will surely realize what we're attempting to do. They will pour everything they have into stopping us. It will be a nightmare. But with the Great Maker's blessing, we just might be able to succeed. You're asking me to join you as a suicide trooper? I asked. For the sake of our universe, Venturi said. Yes. No, I said. I don't give a shit about the universe. I care about the human race. If they die, let the whole universe die with it. You murdered us. I don't mind seeing you murdered in turn. Let the Kargs pile onto every sentient being that didn't come to our aid. You would let the universe die, Venturi whispered. That seems to bother you, huh? He just stared at me. Well, I said, if you're so unbelieving, change my mind. You want us to torture you? Venturi asked. How about instead of that, you offer me something worth my while? I said. What do you desire? Okay, I said. Now you're starting to sound reasonable. You want me to sacrifice myself for you. I want you to sacrifice Lohar hardware and money to save the human race. Meaning what? Venturi asked in a guarded manner. Meaning a fleet of warships that you hand over to us, I said. And you give us the antidote to cleanse the bioterminator from our world. Then you want more? Venturi asked. Hey. You're asking me to die to save the universe. Why shouldn't you have to pay for that? He mumbled quietly. I want automated factories set down onto Earth and other technologies that will give us equality with the rest of the Jade League. Oh, and that's something else, too. I want membership on the League. Voting membership. I am the Prince of Orange to Micah. I am not a magician. Better pull in some markers, then, I said. What does he mean? Venturi asked Sant. Sant shrugged. It means you'd better call in all your favors, I said. Talk to Jade League members. Tell them the score. If you can guarantee these things and show me that it's going to happen, by starting with the fleet of warships, I took a deep breath. 
Do these things, O oh prince, and I'll join your crusade against the Kargs. I'll sell my life as dearly as possible, because I'll have something to fight for then. Admiral or Prince Venturi of Orange Tamica stared at me. He kept blinking those tiger eyes of his. He finally turned away and began to pace. If he'd had a tail, I'm sure it would have been lashing. Yes, he whispered. I can see your point. The Oracle believes in you and in humans, it appears. That will have to be how I convince the others. He laughed sourly. This will stick in the craw of Purple Tamika. Yes, maybe that will make my death worth it. He faced me. I agree to your terms, although I may not be able to convince the Emperor. Well, you'd better, I said. Otherwise, we're going to sit this one out. Tell your purple emperor that. Venturi faced Dr. Sant. The lean doctor bowed low. Without another word, Venturi headed for the exit, taking his honor guards with him. Chapter 12 Several hours later, I was back on the battle jumper with a mass of lohars headed by Dr. Sant. He would be my liaison with the Tigers. I'd already contacted Ella and told her to forget about destroying our warship. Seven Lohar pinnaces guarded the battle jumper. They were lozenge-shaped craft, each of them one-sixth the size of our Jelk vessel. The pinnaces used heavy particle beam cannons as their main armament, making them short-range warships. The Lohars also left two hundred of their stubby fighters and several supply vessels. It amazed me how much hardware sat in the dreadnought. If the Jelk showed up, the Lohars would help us give them a fight. Indomitable already accelerated for the Pluto jump point. When it returned, I was supposed to board with one hundred thousand Earth assault troops. I had several weeks to forge an army of commandos to save the universe. Talk about your melodrama. It sounded crazy, but so did aliens nuking the Earth into oblivion. So did a Rumpelstiltskin-sized extraterrestrial changing before my eyes into an energy creature. Why, then, couldn't there be hyperspace and rips into a hell dimension? At my order, Ella, Rollo, and Dimitri lifted from Earth in the assault boats, returning with the troopers. I sat in my room, thinking. Somehow I was in charge of humanity. Me. I'd been a callow youth, spending a good part of my teenage years in prison with cons. Most of that time I'd read books, history in particular, and military stories and biographies the most. The rest of the time I'd defended my honor with my fists and my wits. Unfortunately, in prison, a shiv or five-to-one odds quickly rendered fists unimportant. That's where wits came in. I'd read history in the prison library and in my cell, and learned about hard reality the rest of the time. Let's be real. Humans could be nice, but sometimes people were more ruthless than starving wolverines. The last of us remained. The mean humans. The tough, desperate, and ornery. Many of the survivors had former military training. That was a plus. The minus was that given the chance, most of the survivors would put a gun to my head, if they could, and demand I listen to whatever they ordered. So how did little old me stay in charge long enough to see this through? Once the Lohars began the surgeries, implanting neurofibers, and once troopers received their symbiotic suits, how could I ensure that I remained the commanding officer? I mean, why would anyone agree to become suicide troopers in the first place? Why would anyone obey my orders? At the moment, I had the sole warship. That was my only ace card trumping the captains or leaders of the freighters. 
Each of them presumably had their core of followers. Most commanded through terror along mafia or feudalistic lines. Mafia had gunmen, feudal lords had knights. Same concept, but in different environments. Some of the freighter leaders used religion to enforce their rule, and a few had voted on things. Those were in a minority. My point was that I was dealing with tough guys and gals who thought and acted upon similar lines as prison cons. The real difference was the freighter leaders were smarter and likely tougher than those losers I'd known in the pen. So once the Lohars began giving us warships and setting down automated factories and cleansing the earth, my ace card would vanish. Heck, I wasn't sure my ace card would survive a few days of training. How could I maintain my advantages? One way, clearly, was by becoming the Lohar's butt boy. I could use their soldiers and ships to make the others obey me. That reminded me of the Spartans back in the day, when they had squared off against the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War. It had been a Greek world war, fought with hoplites and triremes, spearmen and galleys. In the old days, the Spartans and Athenians had hung together and defeated the Persian invaders. After bitter years of fighting each other in the twenty-seven-year-long Peloponnesian War, the Spartans finally went to the Persian great king and sought his financial and naval aid. That helped them finally defeat the Athenians. But, in a sense, then, the Spartans became the great king's servants. I wasn't going to do that here. If I couldn't stay in charge by my own wits, I wasn't going to call in the Lohars to bail me out. I wondered if that made me too idealistic for this. I should use whatever I needed to make this work. But everyone has lines they can't cross. This was mine. End of the debate. I'd give humanity a second chance, if I could, by killing enough cargs and turning off this forerunner artifact. Maybe some of you hearing this wonder why I accepted such a crappy job. I'm not sure why. I think it had something to do with the end of the world, the first time. Seeing those nukes raining down on our cities and the penguins keeling over spitting up black gunk, it did something to me. For one thing, it made me hate aliens with a desperate passion. I'd read a story once where the hero's heart had turned into a hellish, icy hatred. Nothing could reach the man anymore. Not love, not cold, not disease, not pain, not compassion. Nothing. The hatred seethed so deeply that he'd spent twenty long years as an oar slave. It had been a crusader versus Muslim story, with a Turk breaking his word and killing in a nasty way, and later selling the crusader to a bitter life of torment. Well, that oar slave lived, and he found the Turk twenty years later and killed the man at the moment of the warrior's glory. But that's another tale. My point was that some of that infernal rage pulsed in me. My heart had frozen with hatred the day the Lohars killed the earth. Aliens had poked their tentacles into our business and we'd almost died. Now we had a shot again, but another annihilating group of aliens planned extinction of everything this time. Did I hate the Kargs? No. They were giving us this chance. But I had to seal that breach before I could deal with the Lohars and the Jelk how I wanted to. Does that sound egocentric? That I could do those things? Hadn't Prince Venturi said this was a one-way mission? Well, I didn't believe in one-way missions. I'd escaped the Jelk, and they had put a mini-bomb in my head. I'd find a way to beat the Kargs, plug the portal between dimensions, and return to normal space. Then I'd give the Lohars and Jelk grief enough so they'd stay away from my planet. I'd give Earth the chance my dad had tried to give me. From all my reading of history, I realized this was my time in the saddle. I had to draw the sword and hold back the raving hordes. I wanted to be like King David of Israel, the giant killer. I wanted to be like Robin Hood of Sherwood Forest and William Tell, 
George Washington and the defenders of the Alamo. This was my time. And if I failed, I failed all those heroes of the past. Therefore, as I sat at my desk in my room, scratching my fingernails across my scalp, I did some deep thinking. I engaged my wits, so when the time came to swing my fists, I could win. Shortly thereafter, I spoke with Ella, Rollo, Dimitri, and N7. I explained my ideas, my plan. Then I got on the horn and told the freighter leaders that it was time for a face-to-face -face with all of us aboard the Battle Jumper. Twenty-four hours after my talk with Prince Venturi, I presided over the first grand meeting with humanity's leaders. We were in our old cafeteria. The one Cloth had given us when we'd been aboard the Battle Jumper as his assault troopers. During that bad time, this had been the beast area of the ship. We used only a small part of it, with the toughest, most cunning people to outlast the disaster. Diana, the Amazon queen, sat with her chief enforcer, a big black man, six, seven, and easily over three hundred pounds, by the name of Demetrius. She was tall, with wide hips, large breasts, and handsome features. Her thick, dark hair hung in a ponytail, and she wore combat fatigues. Everyone from the freighters was unarmed, so she didn't sport a knife as she had the last time we'd met. Diana oozed cunning and sexual power. Demetrius was huge, bald, and athletic, with the eyes of a Rottweiler. He may have been SAS at one time. Rex Hodges sat beside Demetrius. As I said earlier, Hodges was a former football tacker for the Dallas Cowboys. Rex used to control the other half of their freighter. He had his own freighter now, but they sat together. It likely meant they had learned to cooperate with each other. Good. Maybe they had taken my words several months ago to heart. Several of my troopers stood around the room. Each wore his symbiotic suit, complete with helmet. Many of the people in here dwarfed us in actual size. None was stronger or quicker, though. Jelk science had seen to that. The freighter leaders and their bodyguards had been talking among themselves, a buzz of noise. That died down as I entered with Rollo. I was the only assault trooper not wearing a battle suit. I did that for a reason. I didn't think anyone would try to take a shot at me now. Not that any of them were supposed to have a weapon. But let's face it, throughout history people have been pretty inventive about sneaking weapons where they weren't supposed to be. I raised my arms. The talking died away until everyone watched me. I gave them a quick rundown of the Battle Jumper Starkian fight, the Dreadnought's appearance, its Admiral's request, and that I'd gone aboard her. Many of them knew all this, but I wanted to begin with a recap. Afterward, I gave them the nitty-gritty, the whole story about hyperspace, forerunner artifacts, the portal planet, and cargs. Naturally, some of the leaders questioned everything or wanted more details. I told them about my deal with Prince Venturi, how we would get hardware, cleansing agents, and warships. In exchange for Earth soldiers. Diana said, interrupting me. You sold people to the aliens as if they're a commodity? Wrong, I said. I agreed to an alliance. We'll supply 100,000 commandos, but first we gave them a list of items we want. You're turning 100,000 people into Hessians, she said. The Hessians had been German troops back in the day that fought for the British. In essence, the Hessians had been mercenaries. They did a lot of dying during America's Revolutionary War, and they did some killing, too. The Hessian king received money for his soldiers' service. So, in a sense, Diana had a point. Who will you send on this suicide mission? Murad Bey asked. He was a square-shouldered giant of a man. He was Turkish, with the blackest hair I'd ever seen. He combed it straight back and had a burn scar on his neck. He called himself the Sultan of the freighter Istanbul, by the grace of Allah. 
It also cut to an important point rather quickly. One hundred thousand is a large number, considering how many people we have left, I said. My thought is that some will come from each of your freighters, about 28,000 people from each. To make this work, the volunteers will all have to be former military. That started a babble of shouting and questions. I let them get it out of their system. Finally, I whistled loudly, cutting through the hubbub. Listen, I said. Call it what you want. Maybe we are selling the Lohar's 100,000 soldiers. I don't see it that way, but maybe you do. I can't help that, so I'm not going to sweat it. No, no, Murad Bey said. It matters. No one will willingly go if they believe they're alien slaves. Look, I'm no one's slave, I said. You can believe that. You're going? Diana asked. Her question surprised me. Yeah, of course I'm going, I said. I'm the leader of the assault troopers. That's what they're going to need. Someone who has done this before. You're willing to submit to slavery, Diana said. Okay, I said. It looks like I failed to make myself clear. We're going as Earth soldiers. Think of it like this. During World War II, the Germans invaded and conquered Poland. Later, many Polish soldiers fought with the British Army, but as Poles, not as Brits. They fought in order to reclaim their national homeland eventually. Well, we're doing that. We're getting our homeland now, with hardware to protect it. And we're sending off soldiers to fight to keep it free from these cargs. If you're going... Murad Bey asked in a silky voice, Who will be in charge of Earth during your absence? The attendees glanced at each other as if they were junkyard dogs searching for the pack leader. That hadn't taken him long, had it? Soon the talking among them started up again. Like before, I waited. Let them get it out of their system. Finally, the speech-making died down, and one by one, they looked up at me again. That's the billion-dollar question, isn't it? I said. Before I answer it, I first want to make something clear. I'm coming back. Earth soldiers are returning. You said the Lohar told you it's a suicide mission, Diana said. That's right. He did. She stared into my eyes. Hers were a startling green. Then you're not coming back, she said. I broke contact first. A man could drown in eyes like those. I don't see why that's true. If the Forerunner artifact did its trick once, why can't it do it again in reverse? If you can think of that, Diana said, why didn't the Lohar? I shrugged. He must have a good reason for not believing it will work, she said. People miss the obvious all the time, I said. Aliens aren't any different. The Lohar prince probably didn't even think about it. Diana became thoughtful, finally asking, Do you know how to make the artifact disappear and reappear? I don't have a clue. All I know is that I'm not going as a kamikaze. Sure, this is going to be incredibly dangerous. Every space battle I've been in so far is. But I made it back before. Why not again? Murad Bey's face tightened. Do you intend to rule Earth on your return? I'm a soldier. A killer. I'm going to do what I do best. I've never been a politician. I imagine some of you were, though. And if you weren't politicians before, I'm betting you're thinking about it now. As I see it, we have two questions, maybe three. The first question is, how do I recruit 100,000 soldiers, run them through the surgeries, and train them well enough in time to board the dreadnought? Well, luckily for all of us, I've already got the answer. What is that? Murad Bey asked. I wanted their cooperation. 
We all had to pull together to make this work. But if we couldn't make this work, would the Lohars step in? Yeah, of course they would. Why had Venturi left all those fighters and pinnaces? He wasn't leaving anything to chance if he didn't have to. Before I answer that, I said, I want to tell you that I'm going to give up some of my power now. I know that's something each of you treasures. Let's face it, you're the meanest, toughest, and most ruthless sons and daughters of bitches left of humanity. You're the cream who has risen to the top in each freighter. I know that, and I respect that. I could try to run things like a king, but I'm not interested. I want to beat the aliens too badly for that. I want to make sure humanity survives. That means I'm going to be too busy training to kill aliens for me to run everything. You're going to do that for me. Or for humanity. Murad Bey's eyes seemed to darken into jet-black gems. They shined as if wet, moist with ambition, I suppose. Tell us more, he purred. I gave him a lopsided grin. Before you start, though, the Lohars and I are coming to each of your freighters. We're going to come in force and recruit the candidates. You're all going to stay here as my guests for the moment. Now, I'd rather do this in a friendly fashion with your cooperation, but I don't know if I can convince you in time. And that's something we no longer have enough of. You're threatening us? Diana asked. I shook my head. If it sounds like that, I'm sorry. I don't mean it that way. I'm trying to give it to you straight. I need soldiers now, and I can't afford anyone trying to stop me. How does that share power? She asked. I want you to vote and choose a council of three members, I said. Each freighter gets a vote. In the divided freighters, you'll have to figure out how to agree. If you can't agree, if one of the divided freighter leaders vetoes things, that freighter gets no vote. The three-member council will work with me at first. After I'm gone, well, you're on your own then. But you should have warships by then, and the first automated factories. Do you have a constitution written up? Diana asked. I almost laughed, but by pressing my lips together, I strangled the impulse. It's not going to be like that yet with written constitutions and all. We're going to... to figure things out as we go along. Hey, we're flying by the seat of our pants. The three-person council gives us something to work with. It's a start. In other words, you still plan on making all the choices until you leave, Diana said. This is simply a way to cover the mailed fist. Maybe it seems like that to you now. I don't mean it to be. We're at war. In the Sigma Draconis system, I fought my way back to the Battle Jumper. I came back to the Solar System and freed you. That means I'm going to make a few critical choices right now. But it's not going to stay that way. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why we're setting up a council. Besides, I'll be going away soon. The Council will have the power to run Earth and its new space fleet. Do you believe the Lohars will keep their word? Murad Bey asked. If they want our help, they'd better, I said. Tell us more about this oracle, Diana said. She was sharp. I wish I knew more, I said. Look, there are a million things we could go over, but we simply don't have the time. If you're against this, tell me now. Hard faces stared at me. No one spoke up. I don't know if they knew a story about Saddam Hussein, but they must have instinctively understood such a thing. There had been a time when Saddam Hussein fought a savage war against the Iranians under Ayatollah Khomeini. It had been called the Iran-Iraqi War, and it had been a bloodbath with wave assaults and chemical bombardments. Ayatollah Khomeini said that Iraq had to rid itself of Saddam Hussein for there to be peace. That didn't have much influence until the Iranians started winning. So Saddam asked his council of ministers if he should pretend to step down from power. One man had the courage to speak up. Saddam smiled and encouraged the man. The minister said, 
Let us fool the Iranians, sir. We will put someone else in your place for a time, but it is simply a pretense. Yes, yes, this is very interesting, Saddam said. Come with me and tell me more. The two men walked out of the room. Those in the chamber waited. A single shot rang out shortly, and Saddam returned to the council chamber with a smoking gun. No one else ever agreed that it would be a fine thing to trick the Iranians by pretending Saddam had stepped down from power. The freighter leaders must have realized I would kill anyone who outright fought against me. They were right. I would if I believed I had to. Very well, I said. You had your chance to disagree with me. Now, in order to let you vote for exactly whom you want to, and for each of you to politic without my interference, my troopers and I are leaving. I'm providing food, and there is a restroom past that door over there in the back. Yes, there. You will remain here until you've made your choices. Where are you going? Diana asked. I have tasks to attend to, I said. Good luck, by the way. The human race is counting on you. With that, I left, and my troopers left with me. We locked the hatch behind us, leaving the leaders in the cafeteria. I would not let them out until they had chosen three to lead. I suspected that would take some time. During that time, I had to solidify my position in the commando army-to-be. Chapter 13 I'd talked to the leaders. During that time, Rollo, Dimitri, Ella, and others went down to Diana's freighter in Baja, California. They took thirty troopers with them and the three assault boats. Their task was to return with two thousand recruits. I learned there was some commotion with Diana's people in the freighter, but not much. She'd trained them to think well of me. I'd chosen her freighter for several reasons. One, it was separate from the others. Two, it was grounded, and people likely wanted off bad. Three, Diana trusted me after a fashion, and I believed she'd taken my idea many months ago to heart. I'd told her to create a secret society whose goal was to defeat the aliens. Four, the majority of the passengers were Americans. Did I think Americans were better than everyone else? No, but Americans thought like me, and I needed a core group I could trust. The truth? Most people easily trusted those like them. Many rail against the idea, but facts are facts. I didn't have time for wish fulfillment. My troopers took over the freighter and set up an interviewing schedule. They searched for several qualities. One, I wanted independent operators. In other words, I wanted my people to weed out Diana's plants. The troopers were my political strength in the situation, if you want to put it that way. Two, I wanted those who hated the aliens and desired payback. Three, I wanted soldiers who could take orders. And finally, I desired those who could dream with me, and thus would become loyal. It took a working day for the troopers to pick the 2,000 and head up to the battle jumper. After Ella and Dimitri showed the recruits their quarters, I had a meeting with the remaining assault troopers. We met in a different cafeteria from the freighter leaders. This one stank of onions and a hint of rotten meat. No one had ever liked eating in this place. As I'd expected, the freighter chief still hadn't chosen the three-person council. I got up before my 153 troopers. I already missed those the sleepers had slain, and could have used them. Okay, I began. Here's the situation in a nutshell. We used to be jelk slaves, but we fought our way free. Now we're starting over and already have an alliance with the Lohars, and hopefully soon with the Jade League. I think it's time to use a different frame of reference than our so-called Beastmaster gave us. More than a few troopers nodded. It's up to us to save humanity from the Kargs, I said. If we fail, it is game over. Now, Cloth called us legionaries, 
and I suppose the Lohars think it's a fine name. But you know what? I spit on his slave name, and I did spit right there in front of everyone. I know legionaries were a Roman name, I said. They came from a proud people, and they fought to defend a certain plot of ground. At this point, we don't have a plot of ground anymore. Sure, I want to clean up the earth and repopulate it. That's a long-term goal. But right now, we have to take a leaf from the past. What I'm saying is this. The greatest conqueror in earth history was Genghis Khan. His Mongols swept over an incredible area, riding across degrees of longitude and latitude instead of just hundreds of miles. Some of you may not know this, but early in his career, fellow nomads made a slave of Genghis. In that way, he was like us. But he wouldn't accept his slave yoke. Just like us, he tore it off. And to make sure he and his were never slaves again, he became the greatest warrior the world has ever witnessed. I'm telling you right now, before all of you, we're going to outdo Genghis Khan. We have to defeat the Kargs first, and we have to create a commando army. Well, we're going to copy the greatest Earth warrior. Genghis Khan was a nomad, and the Mongols were nomads. For a time, at least, we're going to be nomads, too. Traveling with the Lohars. I plan to steal several ideas from Genghis Khan's bag of tricks. The one thing he did was make an iron law called the Yasa. We're going to have our own Yasa. One of its keys was never to leave one of your own men behind on the field of battle. Look around you, I said. How many troopers do you see? They looked around. There's not a whole heck of a lot of us left, are there? I asked. No, Ella said. That's why some of you went and got us some recruits, I said. There are one hundred and fifty of us, and we're going to be the colonel of one hundred thousand troopers. That means we need a few more. I want a guard, a corps that I can trust with my life. Napoleon had his old guard. I have you. We don't have much time. The two thousand waiting recruits will get the first neurofibers and symbiotic suits. They'll get immediate training by you. Listen. Each of you is going to get ten to twelve people. You're going to be the sergeant of your ten. You're going to train them to a fine pitch, and when they're ready, Jen and the other nurses are going to operate and implant the fibers. We'll feed them the same growth hormones and steroid 68, too. But here's the critical thing. These recruits are going to be your brothers and sisters. You and us are going to live and die by how well we integrate. They looked at me, and I don't think that too many got it yet. I spoke about changing our ranks, I said. We're not legionaries anymore. We're tossing out all the rankings. I don't want to be like Jelk or Lohars. Instead, we're going to use Mongol rankings, because I think that suits a raider and commando mentality better. The smallest group is the Arban, the ten brothers and sisters. You will live and fight together and look out for each other. You will be the eldest in your Arban, leading them to victory. Ten Arbans will form a company called a Zagoon of one hundred troopers. Ten Zagoons will form a Mingan of one thousand. Dimitri will lead one Mingan, and Rollo will take the other. Are there any questions so far? Naturally, there were plenty, and I answered them the best I could. Afterward, Rollo, Ella, Dimitri, and I went to see the new recruits. We tried to put similar people together. We needed all the bonding we could get right now. Time passed in a blur. A thousand things needed doing, and it seemed as if everyone wanted me to either do or decide the things. After speaking to the two thousand recruits, I spoke to Dr. Sant. He wanted to know the extent of my progress. I wanted to know how the prince was doing with his negotiations with the emperor. Neither of us left happy. I slept like Edison, a catnap here, a short siesta there. 
Jan gave me stems, but only if I promised that I wouldn't take any more without her knowledge. I agreed, and I kept my word. The more I worked, the more I realized delegation was critical. I needed Jan for a host of reasons. To be my personal doctor was high on the list. A hand shook me awake what must have been a day later, and I found myself in the gym. I lay against a treadmill with a towel around my neck. Ella squatted beside me. You're pushing yourself hard, Commander, she said. I groaned, accepting a hot cup of concentrate from her. It tasted like chicken soup. In my younger days, I'd always kept a can or two around as my emergency medicine. When the chills of a cold or the aches of a flu hit, there was nothing quite like chicken soup. The council is ready to see you, she said. Already? I asked. That was quick. Two days? she asked. It's been that long? Ella sighed, plopping onto her butt and sliding against the treadmill beside me. I know you have a lot on your mind. What's your question? I asked, as I slurped chicken noodles. She raised an eyebrow. Ella had gotten leaner. Her cheeks proved it, with a slightly sucked-in look. I'd seen a video once with a woman with cheeks like that. I'd seen the flick at a bachelor party, and I'd never forgotten the porn star's look. Am I that transparent? Ella asked. It took me a second to concentrate. I know you, remember? She smiled wistfully, and I had to look away. I don't think you do know me. I don't think anyone really does. Not even Dimitri? I asked. No, he doesn't really know me either. Ella became reflective. I drank concentrate as she mulled something over. Finally, she began to speak again. I grew up in Siberia. In the wilderness, really. My father was a miner, but he loved hunting more than anything else. He taught me to shoot. I was his only child, and I think he'd wanted a son. Oh, I said. Do I bore you, Commander? Not at all, I said. Not as long as I have some chicken soup to sip. The loneliness of Siberia drove me to books. I read all the time. People called me a bookworm, but I devoured them and thought of myself as a book lion. I like that, I said. I thought you might. My father, he drank far too much. It is a Russian stereotype, but it has a great basis in fact. When he drank, he would preach to me and tell me about Mary, Jesus, and Holy God. He would get angry then, and he struck me more than once. I knew then that God could not exist, not how my father told his stories. I read books about evolution, and we would have terrible arguments. Finally, I left him, and I left Siberia. Because I read so much, I had excellent grades. I went to school in Moscow. There I excelled. Ella Timonchenko laughed sourly. Wouldn't you know it that I was picked to go to Antarctica? That was an even lonelier place than Siberia. My superior told me he had picked me because I must know how to handle the cold and isolation. I should have refused the assignment. What's troubling you, Ella? This oracle the Lohars possess... The forerunner artifact and the ideas about the creator. I cannot accept any of them. There must be hard scientific evidence for each, instead of these alien myths. Maybe you're right. She glanced at me sidelong. Do you believe in the creator? I don't think about it much, but yeah, I guess so. I do not, she said as she made a face. I wondered if she'd look that way in front of her father. It is a preposterous notion, she added. But what do you think about the cargs? She drew up her knees and wrapped her arms around them. 
I do not know enough yet to form an opinion. I know what you mean, I said. She rested her chin on her knees, staring ahead. Finally, she asked, Do you think we will survive the battle? The Lohars don't think so. But the Forerunner artifact vanished once. Why can't it do it again, taking us with it? What caused the artifact to disappear from the Altair system? Ella asked. I grinned at her. That's one of your assignments. Commander? You're the nitpicker, Ella. You don't accept something just because others tell you it's so. I'm all for that. Observe, test, and figure out. I want you alive once we reach the center of the portal planet. You're going to have to make the artifact vanish for us, taking us along. She bit her lower lip. It made her beautiful. This is a daunting mission. What combat mission isn't daunting? I asked. I was in Afghanistan. I used to crap my drawers during a firefight. Truly? she asked, wrinkling her nose. Well, no, I said, and I laughed. She laughed, too. I liked the sound. With a groan, I worked up to my feet. Was there anything else? Yes. If you remember, I told you the council is ready to see you. Okay, I said. Here we go. Wish me luck. Luck she said. But don't you think you should shower first? I'm sorry to say this, Commander, but you have become ripe. I plucked at my sweatshirt, still a little damp from the workout. I want you to keep doing that, I said. What do you mean? Telling me the truth, I said. Then I yanked the towel from my neck and wadded it up, putting it under my left arm as I headed for the hatch. Twenty minutes, a shower, and fresh, clean clothes later, in the cafeteria, I sat down across from Murad Bay, Diana, and a man named Loki. He was tall, chisel-chinned, and had hard eyes like coal. Only when he smiled did that change, giving him an electric sense of charisma with his ultra-white teeth. The three of them looked better rested than I felt. I wonder how they'd managed that. Where's everyone else? I asked. They have returned to their freighters, Murad Bey said. Do you not remember giving the order? I waved that aside. You three finally garnered the most votes, did you? Diana had the most, Loki said smoothly. He had a rich voice, very suave. I learned later that he'd been a Swedish businessman worth a cool billion before the end of the world. Murad Bey had half her number, and I squeaked by. Diana is the president, then, I said. Murad Bey scowled. The big Turk was good at it. Loki examined his manicured fingernails, and Diana kept her face impassive. What powers does the president possess? Murad Bey asked. She's the spokeswoman, I said. She has two votes on issues. Each of you has one. If she disagrees with us, Murad Bey said. Then the thing doesn't happen, I said. But for something to pass, she needs at least one of you to agree with her. You accord her great power, Murad Bey said. He trusts her, Loki said. He does not yet trust us. You Americans stick together, Murad Bey muttered. It has nothing to do with that, I said. She had way more votes than either of you. It sounds to me as if the others trust her more, too. He has a point, Loki said. Bah, Murad Bey said. He makes up the rules as he goes along. He was right. Still, I trusted Murad Bey much more than I did Loki. The Turk spoke his mind. Who knew what the charmer thought? Loki struck me as more dangerous, especially as a politician. What now? 
Diana asked. We have to accelerate the recruiting process, I said. I want to keep the Tigers out of that as much as possible. You can leave the training to me. What you need to focus on is gathering personnel for a space navy and deciding how to recolonize the planet once the Lohars clear away the bio-terminator. Do you trust the Lohars on a long-term basis? Diana asked. No. What do you suggest we do once you leave? She asked. I'm going to try to make sure you get as many weapons as possible. You're going to need soldiers, too. It's hard for me to tell you what to do. I'm leaving. Probably not coming back. What I don't want is for one of you to become the dictator and creating a hell world for the rest. I shook my head, thought about threatening them, and decided against it. I suspected there wasn't much I could teach these three about power. Besides, my real trouble came with recruiting and training. Essentially, Prince Venturi had given me a hopeless task. How was I supposed to create a commando army in a few weeks, one that could defeat an unbeatable menace? The task seemed impossible. But for the sake of everyone, I had to give it a shot. Chapter 14 Our tight time frame forced me to change my mind about the Lohars and their help. Suppose I had three weeks to forge an army. That meant I had to skip parts or speed up others if I hoped to finish in time. Diana suggested something novel. She told me about it several hours after the first council meeting. I escorted her to a docking bay. Murat Bay and Loki had already left the battle jumper. N7 walked behind us while a few Lohars marched ahead. I could hear their servos whine in their powered armor. Diana stopped and she touched my arm. It shouldn't have, but the arm tingled. I wasn't a high school kid in love with her. I loved Jennifer. Diana had sexual power, though. The lady oozed it. Maybe she wielded it with unconscious effort. Uh, I take that back. I think Diana always knew what she was doing. She wielded it with conscious ease. Can I give you a suggestion about recruitment? She asked. I shrugged. She squeezed my arm. I brushed the hand aside and stepped back. She laughed, a throaty sound. There's your problem right there. Yeah? I asked. What's that? She didn't answer directly, but said, If you want the ex-soldiers and the freighters to step forward for you, you're going to have to tell them the truth. Talk to everyone over shipwide intercoms. Right now, too few people trust you enough to step forward and volunteer. I snorted. Tell them the truth, huh? Who's going to join a one-way mission? Why did you just step back from me? She asked. This lady didn't like to answer direct questions. I filed that away. You know why I stepped back, I said. Of course I know, she said. I'm wondering if you do. I already have a girl. Diana smiled sadly. I wonder if you can admit the real reason to yourself. Admit what? You don't trust people's motives, Creed. You're too suspicious. And that's bad? I asked. Most of the time, no, she said. In a case like this, yes. I'm not getting you. What kind of man picks up a gun in defense of his home and community? She asked. It isn't the coward, the self-server, and the liar. It's the man of honor. You haven't been in too many armies, have you? There are lots of cowards, liars. Don't lie to me, she said. I'm not, I said, indignant. We're talking about a certain kind of army, she said. We're not talking about conscripts or those hungry all the time that they join up for a square meal every day. 
We're talking about a volunteer force. A militia, really, jumping up to save their homes. No. We're going to have to be professional if we're going to beat the Kargs. You don't have time to train that kind of force, Diana said. I know what you're hoping. Many of those left are former military. That's a plus. Maybe the key factor to your success. But that still doesn't answer the question. What kind of person will step forward now? I'll tell you what kind. The man of honor. The noble-spirited. Those who understand duty. Humanity's down and almost out. Their service is going to buy us life. That idea will stir thousands of them, Creed. That will give you motivated people who will follow you to hell. This time a literal hell world. Maybe she had a point. So why did I step back from you again? I asked. That's easy. You don't trust my motives. She was right. I didn't. You're going to give Murad Bey and Loki a real run for their money, I said. There's one more thing, she said. Yeah? I know it goes against every grain in you, but you need to listen to me. Against Cloth and the Jelk Corporation, you had exactly the right idea. They were screw masters. The Lohars, however... I hope you're not going to tell me to trust them, too. She stared at me. Those green eyes seemed to see right down into my soul, and she stirred something there. The corners of her mouth quirked upward the way a cat might smile upon seeing a fat, limping mouse. I hardened my heart, and then I mentally hammered steel sheets over that, driving the studs with internal arguments. I already had a girl, one I could trust. Why did I want a succubus? Creed, she purred. I shook my head. Stick to the issue, Diana. Really? She asked, and she touched the top button of her uniform, as if she planned to undress right there. I would have liked to see that, but I turned to go. An answer to your question? She said. Yes, you should trust the Lohars. I faced her with a sneer. I said. No way, that's crazy. She turned down the sexual wattage of her eyes and became all business. It transformed her, and I admit I already missed her trying to seduce me. It's logical if you think about it, Diana said. The Lohars desperately want our help. In this instance, you should use them as much as you can, at least to help train your army. If you think about it, you'll realize that you don't really have a choice. Is that it? I asked. It is. Goodbye, I said. Think about what I said. Sure, I said. And Seven, why don't you escort her the rest of the way? He did. She didn't protest, and I walked the corridors alone until I reached a viewing port. I told myself to forget about her undressing in front of me. Diana was a viper waiting to sting. A fling with her would cost me bitterly later. Still, those eyes. I swore to myself and glared out of the viewing port. Daytime Greenland reflected sunlight. The ocean water to the south of it looked so blue and clean. It wasn't. A Lohar bioterminator poisoned the world's seas and ice. Now Diana figured I should trust the murdering tigers. I stood there for forty-five minutes. My mind whirled and my thoughts fought each other. In the end, I decided Diana knew a few things. In these instances, her logic proved diamond hard. I gave the ship-wide message, and I told everyone the straight scoop. You'd think I'd told them to sign up for free blondes, all the booze you could drink, and a million bucks in the world's glitziest casino. The mass reaction surprised me, 
and it put a lump in my throat. The cons in the pen wouldn't have reacted like that. These people, though. I figured if Diana was right about that, maybe she had a point concerning the Lohars. They wanted our help, our one hundred thousand commandos. It wasn't because they loved us. No, they were desperate. It was time to use their desperation to get the job done. For three glorious weeks, that's exactly what happened. I felt like a rock star strumming his worldwide hits before a vast audience of screaming, cheering throngs. When I walked through the freighters, men and women clapped and cheered. Men shook my hand, squeezing with all their strength. Women hugged, pressing their breasts against my chest. Demetrius, the enforcer, joined up, and he confirmed my suspicion about him. I used to be SAS, he said. The world's best commandos, I said. Some people say that. I put him in charge of training, along with Rollo and N7. Demetrius knew tricks of the trade. The man was scary. The days blurred together, and they were among the happiest of my life. My personal belief was that man was made to work. Unemployment was one of the worst evils, as it stole a man's pride. I worked. We all did. Maybe I worked harder than most. With Rollo's help and an occasional word of advice from Demetrius, I chose the Tumen Colonels. The Tumen was the Mongol division, composed of ten Mingans of one thousand soldiers each. The commando army would have ten colonels. I was the only Earth general. Maybe I should have picked my ten colonels from among the original assault troopers, but I didn't believe that was a smart idea. Command was an art, a hard one, taking years to master. One wouldn't expect a first-year car mechanic or welder to know the trade better than a ten- or twenty-year veteran would. In the same way, none of the original troopers had trained for higher command. We were low-level ground-pounders. I know what a few of you are thinking. If I wouldn't choose colonels from among my veterans, why did I think I would make a good general? Like everyone else, I had double standards and made an exception for myself. Besides, I may not be the best leader, but I was the survivor, the symbol. Sometimes people needed a symbol more than they needed a strategist. In any case, I sought long-term professionals, former officers who had combat experience. I wanted them young, too, in their early forties at the latest. They were going to learn many new things in a hurry. If they couldn't accept the new ways of combat, they would get good people killed. A good combat officer was seldom a nice person. He was a doer, a leader, a go-getter. What was the right way to pick them? In the end, I had N7, Ella, and Demetrius read the resumes. Those they chose, I interviewed personally. After four days, I made my decisions. The Lohars provided instructors, training vehicles, and masses of weaponry. That meant working closer with the Tigers than I wanted. Ella suggested that maybe that was a good thing. You're going to be swimming in Tiger soon. Ten million of them, in fact. From the bridge of a Lohar vessel we watched an orbital planetary deployment, with troopers swarming down onto Mars. The Lohar landers screamed through the thin atmosphere at combat speeds, breaking at the last moment. Troopers jumped out, using jetpacks to soften the final landing. Fifty-nine trainees crashed so hard they died on impact, sending up the superfine Martian dust. Eighteen lingered in the hospital bays several days before dying. Three hundred and twenty-seven broke at least one bone. That was out of seven Mingans, or seven thousand troopers. Not good, I said, examining an e-reader as I stood in the Lohar pinnace. Two of them were in Mars orbit. The next space drop seven hours later with another eight thousand troopers proved even worse. A Martian sandstorm rose up in the middle of the drop. The particles were super fine, as I've said, and the driving speeds caused them to scratch visors. We lost 110 recruits. 
There would likely be fewer injuries once they wore bio-suits and had thicker muscles, but... I set down the e-reader and glanced at Demetrius. Harsh training saves lives later, he said. I know. I hate seeing anyone killed, though. Demetrius's hard face went stone cold. He said in a low voice, There might come a time on the portal planet when you have to order 20,000 soldiers to their deaths in order to win. Can you do that? So this Rottweiler of a SAS man was tough as nails, huh? You don't think I'm hard-hearted enough? I asked. Sometimes I think so, Demetrius said. Watching you fret over this? I don't know. But thanks for the vote of confidence. I'm just telling to you straight, sir. Yeah, I said. I kept wondering about him. Why had the man joined up? Was he honorable? Or had Diana told him to do it? Did the new president want someone like Demetrius on the inside of the commando army? Maybe the answer was a little of both. The first week passed too quickly. The second shot passed even faster, and the neurofiber surgeries killed 307 recruits. What's going wrong? I shouted at Jennifer. She wept as she stood in a surgery center aboard the battle jumper. There were cots with torture-looking devices overhead of each. Lohar doctors had done most of the killing, although many of their subjects had survived the surgeries. My shouts only increased Jennifer's tears. I couldn't take it, and I consoled her. She hugged me tightly and wept even harder, with her face pressed against my chest. She wasn't getting much sleep either, and she had been here for many of the deaths. The Lohars are too rough, she finally said, hiccuping as she did. They're off neurofiber duty as of now, I said. We didn't have an endless supply of humans, never mind the ethics of death during training. Then we'll never meet the quota in time, she whispered. I closed my eyes. There had been far too many training deaths, and it weighed on me. We did things too quickly. It was one thing being a trooper in action, making hard decisions. I had done that against cloth without much trouble in soul. Making cold-hearted decisions as the general? Sending trainees to their death because we had no other choice? That was proving more difficult than I thought it would be. Was I the right man to be general? Okay, I whispered. We'll keep the Lohars here and chalk this up for more payback against them. You're so bloodthirsty, Jen said. It's a character flaw, I said. I guess I hate seeing humans die. She didn't say much more, and soon we parted company, each of us hurrying to our next assignment. The Lohar pride must have convulsed with effort. The same with the Jade League. The Karg menace meant the end of everything. It reminded me of America at the start of World War II. Well, the start of the conflict for the U.S. After the sneak attack of Pearl Harbor, Americans hated the Japanese and feared their navy. The Japanese flat tops sailed supreme from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific. One of the only Japanese failings at Pearl Harbor came as a matter of luck. The three American carriers had been out at sea and had thus escaped destruction. Washington wanted those carriers to harass the Japanese in 1942 as the American Pacific Fleet rebuilt its numbers. The carriers did just that. Finally, the dreaded Japanese Navy and the three American carriers fought a confused and error-prone battle in May in the Central Coral Sea, the first true carrier-to-carrier -carrier action. The conflict was fought solely with airplanes, no enemy ships seeing one another. The Japanese sank Lexington and thought they'd done the same to Yorktown. The Battle of Midway was fast approaching. America was down two carriers to face the Grand Japanese Armada. 
After Coral Sea, the techs estimated it would take three months to make Yorktown battle-worthy again. American workers produced a miracle, repairing it in forty-eight hours of around-the-clock labor, like ants. Yorktown entered the lists for the Battle of Midway, which proved to be the greatest David and Goliath match of the war and one of the most decisive battles. What's my point? At the end of the third week, Indomitable returned to the solar system with its alarming damage repaired in record time. A Lohar miracle. With the dreadnought came old Lohar cruisers and missile ships, seven of them. There were also thirteen supply ships filled with automated factories, a bioterminator cleaning vessel, and three hundred fighter-bomber orbitals. They were all payment to Earth for the commando army. The time had come to test our new government. Who would get the Lohar warships? How would that change the power structure? Could the last humans work together? Or would they let the old diseases of envy, greed, and vaunting ambition destroy the restart? I wish I knew. I didn't have time to find out the plans or even the beginning implementations of the freighter leaders and their henchmen. I was too busy coordinating my commando troopers onto Indomitable. My last act was to divide the warships among them. Diana got two, Murad Bey got one, and Loki won. Then I let Diana, Murad Bey, and Loki each choose an ally to receive a warship. For the last vessel, I put names in a bowl and drew one out, giving that captain the prized starship. I then divided the fighter-bombers evenly among the rest of the leaders. As Mao once said, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. I'd given Earth a government, and those people the biggest guns. They'd have to decide what they could do with them. Time had run out for my commandos and me. Prince Venturi was in a terrible hurry to begin the Karg campaign in hyperspace. I wondered if I'd ever make it back to Earth to find out what happened. And if I did make it back, would I have to fix the problems the Council had made? Chapter 15 The first argument with Prince Venturi didn't take long. We'd landed one-fourth of the troopers when Dr. Sant visited me in Indomitable's hangar bay. Well, in one of the countless hangar bays. Just like the Jelk, the Lohars had a nearly invisible membrane before a vast opening. Each entering shuttle stretched the membrane like a soap bubble, and then, plop, the craft made it through and the barrier snapped back into place. I found it weird to see, but I watched anyway. Lohar landers came through every minute, bringing more of my commandos. I watched, with N-7 and a zagoon of troopers beside me, one hundred bad boys ready to wreak mayhem at my orders. Dr. Sant arrived in a Coast Guard-sized Lohar hover, joining me on the floor. Everything is working like clockwork, I told him. You must have brought through twenty thousand troopers so far. The doctor nodded stiffly. He seemed tense, and he glanced back at the Lohar officers who had followed him off the hover. What was their problem? Prince Venturi sent me to tell you the rest of the commandos are heading for defiance and glory, Sant said. Those were the names of the other two dreadnoughts. My smile disappeared as I regarded Sant. He had lost weight during these past three weeks. I'd learned that tigers reacted to stress worse than humans did. But I didn't think that was it. Sant and I had been getting along. He wasn't too bad for an alien. The Lohars behind him struck me as high brass. They seemed smug, and they watched the doctor a little too closely. Come again? I asked. Sant couldn't help but sneak a peek at the Tiger officers. He straightened his spine afterward and spoke sharply. I believe you heard me, Commander. We're Earth Army, I said. 
That means we will all stick together. I... I am simply relaying orders. Okay. I got it. The brass hats had come along, no doubt, to make sure Sand did as he was told. Maybe someone along the line of command thought he'd gotten soft. Well, I didn't care about that much. But there was no way tigers were going to split my command. I told Sant, but spoke for the benefit of the brass hats. Then you will simply take me to Prince Venturi. I'm afraid that is out of the question, Sant said. Perhaps in a few days. Do you believe you've come to know me, Doctor? To a degree, he said. He glanced at the officers and fidgeted with his paws. I'm unsure if a Lohar can ever fully, truly understand a human, though. Did they figure humans tainted tigers? I didn't care. Forget Sant. Doctor, if you understand me even a little, you must realize that I'm a sovereign nation. I'm afraid the prince was unable to gain you Jade League admittance. Okay. Two things, I said. Why do you refer to him as prince instead of admiral? Has the emperor changed his policy on that? No. Then why call Venturi a prince? I asked. Sand scratched under his chin. I knew that meant he was thinking hard, hesitating to speak. Admiral Venturi, if you please, he said. I glanced at N7 before regarding the tiger again. I think I understand, I told Sant. You're on a death mission, and you must belong to Orange to Micah. The goons standing behind you are also the same. Therefore, Venturi is your prince, and you're going to damn well call him that from now on in defiance of Purple to Micah. That is crudely stated, Sant said. I know. I'm a crude person. Vulgar, I believe the proper word is. Here's the second question. Don't you realize I'm not going to let you Lohars push me around? No one is pushing you. I snapped my fingers. Venturi figures he's going to split up my army, divide my command against me. No way, Doc. One of the Tiger officers lurched forward, speaking with a hiss to his words. It is Admiral Venturi. You will accord the prince the highest respect. Who are you? I asked. The tiger glowered at me, looked as if he wanted to say more, and finally backed away. He must have been under orders to let Sant do the talking. Yeah, the other tiger officer whispered harshly, as if admonishing the first one. It is Doctor, not Doc. Sant said quietly. I know what it is, I said. But if you can't respect me, I'm not going to respect you. Any of you, I said, raising my voice. Sant stiffened. You must take care, Commander. You are aboard Indomitable. Stepping closer to Sant, I said, Take me to him now, or I'm going to gather my troops and storm the nearest transports. Then we're reloading and heading back for Earth. To our moon, I suppose. The Tiger officers stopped whispering between themselves. They stared at me askance. Sant blinked repeatedly. It seemed as if none of them had thought I might react to their ploy. Your people will not follow such orders. Sant said. They... And seven? I said, whirling toward him. Wait, Sant said. I implore you. I let myself turn back to the Lohar, but hesitated several pregnant seconds before saying, I'm a sovereign nation, Doctor. I don't know what you mean by that. Vent... Admiral Venturi will understand, I said. 
Take me to him. Dr. Sant glanced at the Tiger officers. The second one gave the slightest nod. Oh, very well, Sant told me. But he will not be pleased. That makes two of us, I said. N7 tried to explain the situation to me. I waved him silent as we rode a lift through the Dreadnought's main thoroughfare on a rail system, complete with tracks. Our car zipped along at bullet train speeds. There was a constant hiss, though, and the slightest vibration against my back. My Zagoon guard remained with me. It took forty minutes before we marched through fancy corridors. Silk hangings draped along the walls and from the ceiling. It gave the place a royal feeling. Finally, we reached a wider area where Lohar Imperial Guards wearing golden helmets stood around looking important. Beyond is the planning chamber, Sant told me. The prince, the admiral, is busy in a strategy session. Without me? I asked. I believe they are deciding on the best fleet approach to the portal planet. Yeah, whatever, I said. Announce me. Sant scowled, went to the senior guard, spoke quietly, and returned to me. This really isn't a good time, Commander. It never is, I said. Think of it this way. The sooner we talk, the sooner we leave the solar system and save the universe. You are too frivolous, Commander. I'm a lot of bad things. You tell me that all the time. Now hurry along, there's a good fellow. Growling softly to himself, Dr. Sant followed the senior guard through a door. The remaining Lohars, including the two watchdog officers, observed us uneasily. Why do you push him? N7 asked softly. Because he's pushing us, I said. The Lohars have the superior position. That's right, I said. It's even more reason why I can't back down. Look, all we have left is our pride and fighting skills. If we don't parlay that into more, we're finished. That means I have to bluff and bluster. Your logic fails me, N7 said. I know. Bigger doors swished open, and Admiral Venturi stalked toward us. More guards followed him, about thirty more. My Zagoon still outnumbered his boys, which was good. I'm very busy, Commander, Venturi said. He wore more braid than before, and his uniform was scarlet and impressive. I imagine the Emperor had bumped him up in rank. The sidearm was ornate and fancier than ever and his baton had shimmering gilt wound around it. It is good to see you again, High Lord Admiral, I said. There was a pause as the tigers stared at me in silence, as if I'd made a gross blunder. Finally, Venturi spoke gruffly. My title has changed, Commander. Oh? I asked. Belatedly, Sant spoke in a ringing voice. May I present to you Supreme Lord Admiral Venturi of the Avenging Arm of Lohar. It is an honor, sir, I said, deciding to get into the spirit of this. On Earth's behalf, I would like to formally thank you for the seven warships, the supply vessels, and the— Commander Creed, Venturi said. Your decorum is welcome and noticed. However, we lack time. Extreme urgency compels me to cut this meeting short. I see, I said. Then I would like to inform you of a problem. It appears... Dr. Sant has informed me of your irritation. I'd gotten a handle, or the beginning of an appreciation, on Lohar etiquette. They were formal. How they treated one showed exactly what they thought of the person. In that way, they were much simpler than humans, and many times more transparent. 
It meant I couldn't let his interruptions go unnoticed. Clothes make the man was an old saying. Force Alohar to treat you well, and he would automatically think more highly of you. Could have been another. Supreme Lord Admiral Venturi, I said. Despite your vaulted rank, I will not allow you to continue to interrupt me as I speak. I am a sovereign individual, and— The tiger actually put the tip of his baton on my chest. I brushed it aside and stepped closer. His guards bristled. So did mine. Wait! Dr. Sant implored. I put my hand on Venturi's chest and pushed the admiral backward so he stumbled several steps. Claws appeared at the tips of his fingers. He hunched his shoulders and snarled. His guards aimed their weapons at me. Mine rushed forward, some kneeling and aiming at Venturi. How dare you touch me, Venturi said. I am the Supreme Lord Admiral of this fleet. I am an underling of the Purple Tamika Emperor, I said loudly. That stilled Venturi's rant, and it seemed to steal his thunder. I am no one's underling, purple, orange, or otherwise, I said. I am the ruler of Earth. That wasn't exactly true anymore, but I'm sure Venturi didn't know the difference. That means no mere admiral outranks me. That means you will treat me with respect, or I will take my soldiers elsewhere. Are you insane? he asked. We must defeat the Cogs. No and yes, I said. What? he said. I am not insane, and I agree. We must defeat the Cargs. No and yes. Venturi turned to Dr. Sant. Do you understand him? He accords himself high honors, Sant said slowly. If you desire his cooperation, I believe you will have to meet several of his demands. Three painful seconds ticked by. I wondered what went on behind the prince's forehead. The tigers were proud, legalistic, but desperate. Did Venturi have the wit to recognize he couldn't afford a rupture? His reaction would tell me what kind of leader he was, one who worried more about his honor or about winning. Finally, ruefully, Venturi shook his head, and tension seemed to flow out of him. I had forgotten human ways. I have been so busy these past three weeks and worked down to the claw. The Admiral squinted at me. He didn't like this, but he wanted to defeat the Cargs more. He turned and ordered his guards to back up. I did the same with my men. Soon N-7 and I faced Venturi and Sant. The extra Tiger officers had moved back with the Imperial Guards. Why have you demanded to see me now? Venturi asked. We still have much to do and no more time to do it in. I want my entire army in your dreadnought, I said. Is that what this is about, truly? Venturi asked. Yes, I said. He frowned at me, glanced at N-7, scowled, and said, Did you bring the machine along in order to goad me? No. You know I dislike it. Look, Prince, this isn't about what you like or don't like. I take whomever I want with me when I come to see you. We're allies. Now see here. No, I said. You see here. You came to me asking for my aid. I didn't come to you. As you requested, I have brought with me one hundred thousand universe-saving troopers. I have ten million legionaries, Venturi said. Right, I said. We're allies. We've joined forces. 
Your transports have brought part of my army here and informed me the other two-thirds would go elsewhere. You didn't ask me if that was okay. You told me. Well, I'm here to tell you it isn't going to work like that. You have to either understand we're allies or I'm leaving. His tiger-like eyes smoldered, and I almost expected steam to hiss from his collar. He didn't like it. I was inferior, he believed, a savage. No doubt he was the hero in his mind, the great Tiger Prince Admiral saving the universe. My words must have stuck in his craw. Logic dictates putting your forces in several dreadnoughts, Venturi said as if speaking to a simpleton. If one vessel is destroyed, the rest can continue. Sure, that's one way to do it. But it isn't what I'd recommend. What you would recommend? he asked. I nodded. You are not... Hold it, I said. Let's think this through, shall we? His eyes widened, and he sputtered in building rage. I was doing two things now, making a point and finding his limit. The Oracle said you needed human troopers. I told you what it would cost the Empire. You failed to come through with everything, but I let that slide. Now I'm beginning to think you think you can bluff me whenever you feel like it. Well, you can't. That's another thing I'm here to tell you. Silence, he hissed, and it looked as if he was going to take another whack at me with his baton. My zagoon of troopers was faster on the draw than his Imperial Guard. The tigers were surrounded by Lohar hardware. They must have felt safe. My zagoon was in enemy territory, and they were nervous, like good guards should be. Without a word from me, they jogged forward. Are you mad, Earthling? Venturi said. I can have every one of your— I stepped in close, and I used his body to shield my actions from his tigers. He must have seen the oil-wet sheen of my bowie knife. I held the blade in my right hand, close to his lean belly. Admiral Venturi, I said softly. I'm a savage, and I'm insulted much easier than you would believe. Lohars killed my dad and killed my planet. You're cargs to us, if that makes sense. If you want to threaten and bluster, then I'm going to suspect you can't accept our equality. That means you plan to double-cross us. So I might as well stick you in the belly and watch you bleed to death. Then I'll kill your command staff and start a war to take over this fancy dreadnought of yours. I could use it. His overactive eyelids told me I'd hit a nerve. Maybe for the first time this Lohar could actually hear what I was saying. You're going to put all my soldiers in here with me, I said. Then you're going to protect Indomitable so it's the last dreadnought to go down. That gives us the greatest potential to storming into the center of the portal planet. The Oracle said you needed all of us, not two-thirds or one-third. I am the commander of this mission, he said at last. Do you want me for an ally or not? I asked. Let's decide this here and now. Venturi stood frozen, and I give him credit. He didn't seem to care a whit that I held a knife to his belly. His yellow eyes glowed with rage. But there was something else, too. Intelligence. I will lose face before my officers and guards if I back down now, he said slowly. Listen to me carefully, I said. I don't care about your face. That's not my problem. You tried to outsmart me. I know it, and now you know that I know. Eat crow, sir, and remember that I'm Commander Creed, your ally. Not your underling. You are making things difficult. How about that? I asked. Do you think maybe that's why the Oracle told you that you needed me?
It is possible, he said. Now we're getting somewhere. He frowned, and he finally glanced at the knife. You can put that away. I will not threaten you any more. I slid the buoy into its scabbard. You have convinced me, Commander Creed, the Admiral said in a loud voice. I had not foreseen the Karg maneuver you just whispered to me. The Oracle must have foreseen your strategic insight. I will not forget that again. Venturi turned back to Sant and the brass hats. The Admiral raised his baton. There will be a change in policy. We cannot let the Kargs into our universe. To that end, we will need all the Earth Troopers. They will remain in indomitable with me. Our Dreadnought must win through and survive contact with the Portal Planet. Everything depends on it. If it had just been me, I might have laughed in a rude way. I might have told him he was a good actor. Instead, I told myself to remember he was just like Diana, Murad Bey, and Loki. Everyone maneuvered to make himself look good. Humans did it, and so did tigers. Was I expecting angels? No. He was intelligent and had his share of good points and bad. For the good of the mission, this overweening tiger prince had backed down before me. For the sake of Earth, for the sake of my army, I could at least act a little graciously. I thank you for your wisdom, Prince Venturi, I said. It is apparent to me why your pride chose you to lead this sacred mission. The fate of the universe rests on your military skill. The Commando Army of Earth proudly serves with Alohars in this, the deadliest peril to life anyone has ever witnessed. I stood ramrod stiff, and I gave him a precise salute. Venturi studied me, and I couldn't tell what went on in his tiger brain. The first self-inflicted crisis of the mission had passed. I doubted it would be long until we faced the next. Chapter 16 the Lohar shuttles hauled every Earth Trooper into Indomitable. I spent the next several hours making sure my people found their berths, had their symbiotic suits and weapons. The Tuman colonels had small staffs. I had a tiny one. We were doing this mean and lean. My eyes hurt after reading so many manifests, and I wondered if I'd been better off as a jilt trooper. Freedom always took more work. Being a slave was easy, like a child. Let someone else do the thinking. I'd had enough of that in prison. Even so, I was tired, and I wouldn't be letting my eyes shut for quite some time still. The Lohars had sophisticated gravity plates, better than what I'd seen on the battle jumper. I remember feeling a slight bump. I swayed and grabbed hold of a rail. I had been marching down a corridor with my security zagoon, N-7, and Dr. Sant. The two tiger watchdogs had stayed with Venturi. Sant and I hadn't said anything about the last incident. It made me wonder if the Lohars used bugs and hidden video cameras. I made myself a mental note to have that checked out later. I grabbed the bar as the jolt made the security troopers sway just like me. Is there trouble with the ship? I asked Sant. In what manner? he asked. Didn't you just feel that? Yes, of course I did. Lohars have keen sensibilities. I'm sure that's true. What was that, then? What caused us to sway? We're accelerating, Sant said. I believe at three or four gravities. You're kidding. Dr. Sant jerked at his uniform as if straightening it, which I'd come to learn was a sign that a Lohar figured I'd insulted him. They were as touchy about their honor as medieval samurais. What now? Then I understood what I'd done. 
Dr. Sant, sometimes a human says you're kidding as a way of speech. It does not mean to imply the other is joking or being frivolous. Yes, yes, I know that, of course. I have been studying you for over three weeks now. I am the ship's xenopsychologist. I stared at him, and it clicked. You know, Dr. Sand, I'm going to have to insist that every listening device and camera be removed from human living quarters. But that's preposterous, he cried. That you have them trained on us, or that you're unwilling to have them removed? He stood there, frozen, and finally whispered, How did you know? I cannot understand your insights. What I've come to believe are your intuitive leaps of thought, Commander Creed. You are an enigma to us, and that is making certain important people... Nervous? I asked. He straightened his uniform. I will see what I can do concerning your request, he said. Thank you, Dr. Sant. Having you as the liaison officer has made things much easier for us than it otherwise would have been. I've learned to trust you and your insights. I don't see why you're saying— I held up my hand so he quit talking. Then I gave him a salute, one less precise than I'd given Venturi. But I believed it would help Sant in whatever internal debate he'd have to go through with the watching Lohars. Clearly he spoke for their benefit. And now so did I. A glimmer of understanding sparkled in the doctor's eyes. His manner lightened. He gave me a similar salute, no doubt as a sign of respect. Then he took his leave with loping Lohar strides. They seemed like the most athletic NBA stars, the natural athletes. The Tigers weren't the most cunning aliens. The Jelk easily outdid them in that regard. But they did have size, strength, and agility. Against an average human, I'd bet on the Lohar. Against us modified and trained troopers. I yawned, and I debated getting another stem from Jen. I shook my head. She was setting up an infirmary. It might have been a useless gesture, given we were headed to the last battle. But I wanted to do everything I could to make the troopers believe this was a two-way mission. A soldier who believes he can survive will take greater precautions during combat to ensure that happens. Japanese banzai charges in World War II proved the idea. Suicidal soldiers became too reckless with their lives. I'm sure a suicidal soldier figured, since I'm going to die anyway, why not do it with abandon? Courage was critical to good soldiering but so was survival. I believed George S. Patton's saying, no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. The infirmary should have shown our boys that I believed what I said. I did believe it, at least until I went to the Lohar strategy session. That was wild, and it went bad in a way I would have never foreseen. If I hadn't gone to it, though, I don't like to think about that, either. Was it fate I happened to be there, or just dumb luck? What happened? Supreme Lord Admiral Venturi belonged to Orange, to Micah. The Emperor had bumped him in rank, and Venturi ran the Three Dreadnought Flotilla. Politics back home must have shifted, though. The Emperor must have had second thoughts, and he used the fastest Lohar ship in the fleet to tell everyone his new decision. Before I relate the strange strategy session, I should let you know something about the Dreadnought as a class of hyperspace vessel. I saw it later, but this seems like a good point to describe it. Hyperspace, as I would discover, had many weird properties. I suppose that made sense, given its aspect. Consider a universe, a space-time continuum, as a balloon. It could be a water-filled balloon, one crammed with helium, or one that a kid just blew up with his mouth. Actually, that's a good way to think about it. Each universe had its own properties, its own realities. Water, helium, or mixed lung air. A fish couldn't swim in helium, 
just as a human couldn't exist in some of the theoretically different universes. Suppose now that all those balloons were stacked or dumped into an auditorium. The balloons would lay against each other in a mass, piled on top of one another. The small areas between the balloons would be like hyperspace. It was non-space-time continuum, outside universes. Hence, it was different. What kind of engine and equipment would it take to leave a universe, travel through hyperspace, and enter another space-time continuum? I'm not a scientist or much of a mathematician. Ella and N7 tried to explain the precise concepts to me more than once. Mostly I blanked out those times with glazed-over eyes. Yet, I suspect that the majority of you are how I used to be in grade school. If the math teacher explained a problem to me in her adult jargon, I got confused. If another kid explained it to me plainly, a light bulb went on in my head. The balloon analogy falls apart here, because we couldn't just tap out of a universe anywhere. There were weak spots in a space-time continuum, and we needed the right equipment to tell us where reality was frail. That meant we had to travel to a soft spot to enter hyperspace there. Then we had to travel through non-reality to reach the portal planet. Are you with me so far? Good. The energy needed to bust out of our space-time continuum was vast. From a human perspective, the engine doing the breakout proved to be colossal. That meant the dreadnought had outrageous size. In the middle of the ship, with the volume of a small lake, was a globular area holding an artificial black hole in its exact center. I know what you're thinking, because I thought it as soon as I learned about it. The Forerunner artifact, the Taurus object, had a black hole in its donut center. The point is obvious. Black holes helped one escape a universe. Now, I'm not saying Indomitable had a black hole in the middle of the ship. It had an artificial black hole. Both N7 and Ella assured me that made a huge difference. Whatever, huh? When they talked like that, it made me want to pull him or her behind a gym and beat the crap out of them. Not that I'd ever done that before as a kid, mind you. I'm just saying. Around the artificial black hole, around the lake-sized liquid volume were billions of tons of special engines, computers, and equipment. That gave the dreadnought its size. No one entering or leaving Indomitable ever went into that inner sanctum part of the ship. Sealed in there was a special class of Lohars, a concentrated order half adept and half scientist. I'd been told they read ancient writ chanted prayers, and used semi-divine instrumentation and machines to take us out of our reality and into hyperspace. What struck me was the size of everything more than the technology. It reminded me of old footage of the Apollo space missions. I'm sure you've seen all those Houston geeks in their white shirts and narrow ties, with their sixties buzz cuts and black-rimmed glasses. In the background would be the computers. Banks and banks of them, with less computing power than any laptop a kid would have used at school before the Tigers dropped nukes on us. The Lohars were like the 60s Americans with computers able to get a man on the moon. It struck me there should have been miniaturized versions of the hyperspace ripping equipment. Instead, we had first-generation stuff that could get the job done, but man, oh man, it was honking bigger than what future Lohars would use if we could get to the Forerunner artifact and stop the Kargs from killing the future. I lay down on my cot and shut my eyes. It took time for several of my back muscles to stop twitching. Finally, I fell asleep, getting a solid six hours. Before Sant returned to us, N7 woke me. I sat up, groggy. You'd think with such a monstrous vessel that everyone would have plenty of room. No. I felt like a Japanese apartment dweller living in a coffin. There was a cot, a stand with my bowie knife and an old forty-four magnum on it, and a stool. Diana had given me the nickel-plated pistol as a gift, complete with a holster. How she'd learned I'd used one in Afghanistan, I don't know. 
I'd been wearing the gun on the ship as a reminder I fought for those back home. Anyway, N7 sat erect on the stool. If he leaned back, he'd be touching the hatch. If he leaned forward, he'd be hovering over me in my cot. My room was like a coffin. I wiped accumulated gunk out of my eyes and groaned. My head hurt, making me wonder if I was coming down with a cold. Admiral Venturi has summoned you to a strategy session, N7 informed me. When? It begins in an hour. If you leave now, you'll get there with ten minutes to spare. Shh. You'd think they would have a faster way to move around their own starship. I suggest you shower and eat immediately. You're running out of time. Yeah, I said, sliding down to the end of the cot. N7 stood. The hatch opened and he stepped into the corridor. An officer walked past, glanced into the room, and hurriedly turned away. We were learning to live together in these cramped quarters and give each other privacy by not noticing things. Where are you going? I asked. To summon Ella, he said. To do what? To join you, N7 said. I'm taking you to the strategy session. I do not suggest that, Commander. This was interesting. Does it bother you when the Lohars call you a machine? Do not be absurd, N7 said. I am too logical to let bigoted comments affect my equilibrium. Then why don't you want to come? Aren't you curious what they're going to say? I am curious, yes. But you have... Hmm... Ruffled them enough for now. I am also to inform you that Lohar technicians have arrived and have begun removing spy equipment from our living quarters. So Sand succeeded, I said. Good for him. I frowned thoughtfully at N7. It seems to me they're doing what we want. Let's keep pushing so they continue to do so. There is a time to push and a time to relent. I suggest that now would be a good opportunity to show the Admiral that you are able to cooperate as well as you are able to push. N7 had a point. I wonder why they don't like androids. Agreed, N7 said. It is an interesting question. You don't have any ideas? I suspect it has a philosophical reason. Which, for the Lohars, means a religious reason, I said. I believe that is what I just said. I ran my fingers through my hair. I must have been more tired earlier than I realized for me to feel this groggy. Time is running short, Commander. You should have already showered. Okay, I said. Grab Ella. Tell her she's coming with me to the session. And alert my security team. I suggest you leave them behind today, N7 said. Nope. The Zagoon stays with me all the time. I don't have a great big ship and ten million tigers to call on. I don't have an empire. I have our small army. One thing I'm going to do is be strong at the point of contact as much as it's in my power to do so. I yanked on a pair of pants and began buckling on my knife and gun. By continuing to bring your Zagoon everywhere, N7 said. You antagonize the Lohars. I think that's just what I said. N7 surprised me, and he let the corners of his lips upturn in the slightest smile. Let's hurry, I said. Go get Ella. N7 left, the hatch shut, and I stretched good and hard before getting started. A strategy session. I wondered what that would be like. Chapter 17 In a way, this reminded me of the Starkian strategy session aboard their ship when I'd been a jelk trooper. I don't mean the Lohars sat on the floor or hooted like baboons. They were more formal and dignified than that. We sat at a great rectangular structure. 
Each commander faced inward, surrounded on three sides by table, with staff standing behind him or her. I had Ella, and realized too late that I should have brought more people. It would have made me look more important. My security zagoon was outside with the admiral's guards, but it was too late to grab one or two of them to stand behind me. While the Lohars didn't strike me as bureaucrats, they definitely had certain bureaucratic mentalities. The bigger the entourage one had, the more important he was. It went ditto for the more nifty uniform, medals, etc. I had compensated on the spot as Venturi's guards scanned my nickel-plated magnum. No lasers or needles were allowed within the main chamber. The gun looked impressive, so I told them it was part of my uniform, an ancient earth sidearm of harmless design. Lohars didn't use gunpowder weapons, and their scanners proved it wasn't electric in any way. The guard still balked, so I'd said, It's like a medal of honor. I received it for courage in the line of duty. That they had understood, finally letting me pass with it. Each dreadnought admiral sat at the gigantic table. There were also ten Lohar marshals, one for each million legionaries. Fighter wing generals sat at the table, the captains of suicidal attack craft and the chief officer of the Lohar teleportation missiles. Finally, a number of the oldest-looking tigers I'd seen so far, wearing shimmering orange robes with acolytes behind them, sat with us. They were holy adepts, akin to Catholic bishops, but in the Lohar religious hierarchy. I sat down at the end, directly across a great breadth of burnished metal from Supreme Lord Admiral Venturi. I might have pointed out that as the Lohar's only ally, I should be sitting beside the prince. But I let this one pass. He had one end of the table, I had the other. Who was to say which person sat at the head of the table? I cracked my knuckles and gained a few sour looks from the nearest legion marshals. I found it interesting the infantry soldiers sat down here at the low end. As far as I saw it, we were the key to everything. The flyboys and priests saw things differently. I guess such thinking held true for both human and tiger versions. Maybe we foot-sloggers had more in common than we realized. The door opened and the senior guard announced Dr. Sant. He hurried to me. I am to help liaison with you, Commander, Sant said quietly. Does that meet with your approval? Certainly, I said. Thanks for coming. I lowered my voice. And thanks for talking to whoever was in charge of spying on us. He nodded curtly, and I wondered if he wore a bug. I didn't ask, and the meeting started soon thereafter. The oldest tiger of all rose, with his robe shimmering. He gripped a metallic sphere in his trembling paws. The thing had the size of a bowling ball. Lifting his face toward the ceiling, the old Lohar began to chant, and what Sant informed me later was the speech of the First Ones. It sounded alien, and it made my spine tingle. He went on a long time, and finally the globe in his hands began to pulse with an eerie light. Tigers gasped. Many made holy signs. A few even cried out in what sounded like anguish. The Ancient One became more animated, speaking louder than ever. He raised the object in his paws and released it. The thing hovered in place. At that, Lohars began to roar and cry out. Some slumped forward, crashing their torsos onto the table, as if all their strength had left them. Many closed their eyes. The radiance in the floating sphere reminded me too much of the Forerunner artifact in the Altair system. I didn't like it, and I expected to hear heavenly singing at any moment. Instead, Ella bent near and whispered, Interesting, is it not? I suspect that is a piece of foreigner technology. I half turned, staring at her in amazement. Please, Sant whispered, with a tremor in his voice. You mustn't speak at a time like this. It is sacrilegious. 
that the globe shines shows us the great Maker hears our prayers. You can't believe such nonsense, Ella whispered to him. I grabbed her sleeve, gave her a significant glance, and shook my head. She made a face, looking as if she was going to say more. This is important to them, I whispered. The sphere isn't holy, she told me. It's old, maybe ancient technology. I'd like to study it, Commander. Maybe it could be helpful to us with the object in the portal planet. No, no, Sant whispered, sounding scandalized. Only the purest Lohar can handle such a relic. For a human to touch it, we would have to kill every one of you and burn your planet. Now I implore you, compose yourself and feel the awe of this singular moment. Ella looked pissed. She wasn't letting go of this. I gave her a stern glance and tugged at her sleeve one more time. Finally, reluctantly, she drew back. The tigers nearest us were too fixated on the moment to have noticed our whispered conversation with their glazed manner. I actually saw drool spill from one marshal's open mouth. I wanted to view this through Ella's eyes. The radiance of the globe was making me edgy in a way I didn't like. If this went on much longer... But no, the old adept put his paws on the radiant globe. He pulled the object toward him, and the light dimmed. Finally, he tucked it away within his robe, although I noticed a bump there, like a man with a big concealed carry weapon. Tears glistened in the adept's eyes. He cleared his throat. Tigers stirred, pulling themselves off the table, sitting upright. Many adjusted their caps and smoothed their uniforms. Others blew their nose and dabbed their wet eyes. It was an emotional occasion, and it took time for the Lohars to settle down. The Great Maker grants us his blessing, the ancient adept said in a quavering voice. We are his chosen ones to do his holy bidding— we have been given a sign that our task will succeed. If in it we die, we die. If we die, we die, the Lohars chanted, every one of them, including Sant. The old one looked as if he would continue to sermonize. Admiral Venturi must have given him a signal, though. The adept swiveled his trembling head until he faced the admiral. This is glorious news indeed, Venturi said. We are the Lohars, the adept said. We are the Lohars, everyone else chanted. We are the Lohars, the admiral said in a soft voice. Finally, the adept lowered himself until he seemed to sink against his chair. An equally ancient acolyte shuffled forward and patted the old one's head. That would have been demeaning to a man, but not, apparently, to a tiger. The pat must have signaled the end of the religious ceremony. Venturi rose, and he held his own object. His was blue and small like a TV remote. In the end, that's exactly what it was. With a click, he switched on the table. I don't know what kind of technology you'd call it, but I could look down into the table and see what I took to be an estimation of hyperspace. It seemed as if the table sank twenty feet. I could see the objects on the screen with perfect clarity, even though I sat so close to it and peered at a sharp angle. Ella told me later that she couldn't see the images as well until she moved in close to the table. The Admiral spoke about the coming mission its importance, the objective, and the heinous nature of the cargs. I learned then why the attack craft were suicidal. The Lohars couldn't exist for long in hyperspace except while aboard the Dreadnoughts. The massive starships were special in many ways, with thick, ultra-effective shielding holding back the baleful influences of hyperspace. Those in the freighters and other space vessels would have short lifespans. The same would be true for legionaries on the portal planet. 
and Churi speculated that the deeper the legionaries traveled into the planet, the more shielding they would have from hyperspace and the longer they could survive. Those who would remain on the surface in giant fighting tanks would only have a limited amount of time to achieve their military objectives. Listening to the monologue drove home to me the suicidal willingness of the Lohars to go the last mile. I didn't hear anyone bulk about doing this. Every tiger looked dedicated, and each seemed to realize there was no return from the Karg-held portal planet. I wondered about that. What made them willing to die to save the universe? What had made a suicide bomber back home willing to kill himself? Why had the kamikazes flown their planes into American ships during World War II? In the end, it seemed to me, it had been a mix of love of country and their religious beliefs. In Afghanistan, I'd hated the suicide bombers. I'd lost friends to them. But that didn't mean I couldn't try to figure out the other man's motives. From what I'd seen of the two races, Lohars and Jelk, it was clear Cloth and his brethren were smarter and filled with greater cunning than the Lohars. But a Jelk wouldn't die for anyone or anything. He served himself. Their corporations worked to feed them. Lohars had loyalty, courage, and a willingness to die for the betterment of the group. Eventually, Venturi sat down, opening up the discussion. One by one, marshals, generals, officers, and adepts rose. They spoke about courage, devotion to duty, hatred of the Kargs, and a desire to shut forever the dimensional door between space-time continuums. There was little talk about how to fight better or offer some sly maneuver. I had the sense the Lohars understood one thing how to advance into the teeth of enemy fire. I was beginning to get a better handle on why the assault troopers had beaten the tigers each time. The Lohars had hurt us, but in the end our superior tactics had won out. As an adept sat down and another marshal rose, I spoke up. Excuse me, Supreme Lord Admiral Venturi, but could I please see a projection of the portal planet? Silence descended, and all the tigers swiveled around to stare at me. I'd never felt more like a pariah. It speaks, a marshal said, the one standing, a burly female with a five-claw symbol on her cap. I believe her name was Marshal Danielle. Venturi stood. One of the marshal's aides saw this, stepped behind Marshal Danielle, and whispered in her ear. Upon seeing Venturi on his feet, the marshal hurriedly resumed her seat. Many of you have wondered upon our human ally, Venturi said. Their leader requested the honor of attending a strategy session. This I granted, for the Oracle has stated its desire that an army of human troopers join us in our crusade. I am aware of this ancient breach of etiquette. Yet the humans are also sacrificing their lives for the betterment of our race. Could I stand on the old codes when blood willingly stepped forward for such a holy cause? We must obey the ancient dictates if we desire the great Maker's blessing, the old adept said, the one who had lifted the radiant globe earlier. I do not want to pick a quarrel with you, esteemed one, Venturi said. I am not sure I agree with Purple Tamika's reading of the Oracle, the old adept added in a quavering voice. The human's presence in our dreadnoughts sullies our crusade. The Creator has chosen the Lohars to guard the Forerunner artifacts. He has not chosen these ill-befitted creatures, these hounds of the devil Jelk. They soldiered for the Jelk under false pretenses, Venturi said. The trembling old ancient struggled to his feet. He faced the admiral. Let me repeat the key phrase of your statement, Supreme Lord. They soldiered for the Jelk. 
How can you impugn us with their presence? No, I say we must slaughter these vile sub-devils and rid ourselves of any taint of evil. But the oracle, Venturi said. Purple Tamika misread the oracle, the old adept shouted. He aimed a trembling finger at Venturi. You jeopardize the mission, Supreme Lord Admiral. You have accepted the underhanded reading of the oracle by a self-serving... Venturi pressed a stud on the table. A klaxon blared into life. I clapped my hands over my ears. Finally, the admiral removed his finger and the blaring sound stopped. It left a ringing in my ears. I am Prince Venturi of Orange to Micah. I have led many to Micah raids, and I signed the Accord of Ten. There is peace between Purple and Orange, and because of that I saved our to Micah from certain destruction. We have made our peace with Purple. They view the Great Maker and the Oracle from the same vantage as us. Let me ask you a question, esteemed one. Do you refute the Accord of Ten? The old adept had lowered his arm. He looked down as his shoulders slumped. Do you refute the Accord of Ten? Venturi asked again, in a louder voice. As leader of this mission, I demand an answer. The old adept's head snapped up. You demand? he asked. I am on my warship en route to battle, Venturi said. I am the Creator's representative in this hour. You know that, esteemed one. You spout the principles of Octagon Lars. Yes, Venturi said in a ringing voice. I have no more to say, the adept whispered. Venturi rapped the table with his knuckles. No. First you must answer me. Do you refute the Accord of Ten? The Ancient One reached into his robe. I hold the stone of God, he said. Do you refute it? No, Venturi said. I would like to point out, however that it shone with radiance in the presence of the human commander. The old adept swiveled around to stare at me. His eyes burned with fervor. Finally he withdrew his hand from the robe. The stone has shone, he said. I cannot refute the great maker's blessing. Now I will lessen and you will grow greater he told Venturi. We both go to battle the menace of the age, Venturi said in a softer tone. We both go to die. Yes, the adept said, and he sank back into his seat. Venturi scanned the throng. Then he addressed me. Do you still wish to speak? I do, I said. Then stand and tell us your words. Admiral Venturi thereupon sat down, waiting for me. I stood up and I scanned the assembled throng. The tigers were on a crusade, and none of them believed we were coming back. I didn't like that. How should I word this? I wasn't sure. I didn't want to make anyone angry. I wanted them to see sense. I'm grateful for this chance to see the Lohars in their glory, I began. I had not realized until this moment that the Lohars were the chosen of the Creator. Tigers gasped, and stares of amazement filled many eyes. It is true. We of Earth... I wanted to tell them we of Earth would hunt every Lohar down and blast them to death as they had done to us by nuking our world. Instead, I bent my head, looking at the table. I had to control these surges of rage against my newfound allies. I had to think of the greater good. 
He is overcome with zeal, a tiger whispered. He is reverent toward our crusade, I heard another say. I almost smiled. The tigers misunderstood my silence. Well, I suppose it was for the best. Looking up, I said, We face a terrible foe in the Kargs. It is good that two races from our universe join together to fight for life. I admire your willingness to sacrifice your lives. All here know that the Lohars are the bravest of the brave. Yet, as I've listened to you discuss strategy, I couldn't help but pause. I'd heard almost no strategy discussion at all. Maybe it was coming. Thus I paused to let someone correct me. No one did, though. Instead, many tigers hunched toward me. I already knew enough to realize they were interested in my words. As I've listened to you, I repeated, an idea boiled into existence. Perhaps the radiance from the Creator's stone lit my mind with understanding. I have been thinking deeply on ways to defeat the Kargs. By fighting, Marshal Danielle roared as she banged a fist against the table. We will defeat them through our valor and with our laser rifles. We will march to victory, killing and being killed to reach the holy object in the center of the portal planet. Murmurs and cries of assent filled the chamber. Thank you, Marshal, I said. Your ringing endorsement for the coming fight gladdens my heart. I... Hold, Venturi told Marshal Daniel. You must let our... our... ally speak. Thank you, Supreme Lord Admiral, I said. I have heard about the valor of Lohar legionaries. I have even seen them in action. Ella sucked in her breath but it appeared that none of the tigers present understood my implication. So I know that each of you here is dedicated to the mission of saving our space-time continuum. Since I am not a Lohar, I view these proceedings from a different vantage point. I bring my human insights to the mix. I admire the idea of driving in with ten million legionaries, inexorably drilling to the center of the planet— we will slaughter ten billion Kargs. Ten billion? Marshal Daniel asked. There are ten billion Kargs on the planet? He cannot know the precise number, the old adept said. The ancient gasped as if overcome by a new thought. Do you have precognitive insights? Are you a prophet? Marshal Daniel asked me. No, I said. Remember, I'm human. I speak from human perspectives. I don't know the actual numbers, just that it's going to be more than we have, right? We have ten million legionaries. So when I say ten billion cargs, I'm simply expressing the idea that they'll have a lot more soldiers on the ground than we do. Expressionless tiger eyes stared at me. Many cargs will be there, I said. We will likely have to kill them ten to one to reach the Forerunner artifact. Can we achieve such a kill ratio? Marshal Daniel asked Venturi. It could prove to be an impossible task, another marshal said. Venturi rose to his feet. Why do you say such things? he asked me. Uh, well... Among humans, when we have a strategy session, we usually discuss strategy, tactics, and odds, I said. Lohars glanced at each other in amazement. Anyway, I said, I have a way to solve our dilemma. Reluctantly, Venturi sat. The others regarded me anew. I fought against Lohars at Sigma Draconis, I said. Scowls appeared. I did not do so because I wanted to. Shark Cloth, our Jelk, desired to reach the Shrine Planet there. During the battle, I observed Lohar battle practices. Many of your weapons and tactics impressed me, by the way. 
Again, while in Earth orbit, I saw the Starkians use your famous teleportation missiles. Many of the Tigers stared at the T-missile officer. He was shorter than the others, and his uniform a dull blue color. Something seemed wrong with his left eye, and I realized it must be glass. The pupil never moved. In fact, I said, it was through using a teleportation missile that I gained my freedom from the Jelk and inflicted great harm against Cloth. By the shine in their eyes, that had their attention. Therefore, I speak with more than a little experience about the T-missiles, I said. We've just seen that we face tremendous obstacles against the Kargs. It will be a bitter and difficult fight to reach the center of the portal planet. Yet we must reach it. We must turn off the Forerunner artifact and close the rip into the Karg space-time continuum. To that end, I suggest we make it easy on ourselves and ensure our universe of victory. How? Marshal Daniel asked. I nodded. That's the right question. I'm surprised they hadn't seen it yet. We gauge the distance to the center of the portal planets and teleport the missiles there. Kaboom! We obliterate the Forerunner artifact and turn off the rip into the Karg universe. We save ten million Lohar legionaries and escape back into our own continuum with our lives. That's brilliant, I heard Ella whisper behind me. I stood there beaming. I thought it was pretty brilliant, too. The tigers sat in shock. A few slumped back against their seats. The ancient adept turned to Admiral Venturi. Did you hear his words? the old one asked. Venturi also stared at me. Slowly he nodded. It is the rankest blasphemy I have ever heard, the old adept whispered. We must skin him alive and set him adrift in space. Set him adrift, Marshal Daniel roared. He desires to destroy the Great Maker's handiwork. He is a blasphemer. Oh, boy, Ella muttered behind me. Wait a minute, I said. You're wrong about that. The Creator didn't make the Forerunner artifact. I've heard you say the First Ones did it. Hey, the ancient adept cried. He subscribes to the Waylander heresy. The crusade cannot abide heretics. Admiral Venturi, you must skin him alive with your own blade and offer him in sacrifice. This is blasphemy, blasphemy. We are all tainted by his presence. We must purify ourselves. We must... And Churi pressed the klaxon switch. I knew now why it had been installed. The wailing noise stilled the adept thirsting for my blood. Finally, the ancient tiger slumped back into his chair, exhausted. Only then did the admiral remove his paw from the switch. You have heard the human's words, Marshal Daniel said into the silence. Listen. I said. No, the adept wheezed. We mustn't listen to another word he says. He taints us. He taints us. I ask my ally to resume his seat, Admiral Venturi said in a low voice. Reluctantly, I sat down. Ella patted me on the shoulder, and she whispered in my ear, We're caught up in a war by a bunch of religious zealots. This is worse than cloth. I shook my head. I didn't believe that. But this did look bad. I am shocked by his words just as you are, Venturi told the others. Yet we must remember that the humans are new to space. They are ignorant savages. Then why are they with us? Marshal Daniel asked. Because the oracle told us to gather them, Venturi said. It is that simple. Believe me when I tell you that I would rather exterminate every one of them. But the great maker has used the oracle. 
We have gathered commandos who will rid our continuum of the Kargs. You still believe this? Daniel asked. They have yet to learn the Creator's ways, Venturi said. Once they do... They are heretics, the old adept said. They can learn nothing. I have spoken. Perhaps they are heretics, Venturi said. Yet you must recall that the Lohars too once followed lost ways. It wasn't until we found the spire of the first ones and the original writ that we turned to the truth of the great maker. Meaning, the adept whispered, that once we held on to false beliefs, Venturi said. But the human spoke so confidently, the adept said. He was proud in his heresy. I wonder if he is still proud, Venturi said. Commander Creed, do you continue to believe that we should use thermonuclear weapons against the Forerunner artifact? No, I said, lying through my teeth. I spoke in ignorance, without understanding. Hearing Lohar outrage has helped to rid me of my false thoughts. Murmurs of amazement went through the assembled chamber. Do you hear? Venturi asked the old adept. Your words help to teach him the truth. The Ancient One studied me with wet, red-rimmed eyes. He is sly like a jelk and a Starkian. How do we know we can trust his words? Because the Oracle called upon us to gather him, Venturi said. Circular reasoning, Ella whispered to me. Do you retract your heretical idea? Venturi asked me. I fully retract it, and stand embarrassed that I spoke such a thing to you, I said. I believe him, Venturi said. On such a subject I do not think that even a savage could spin deceit. Aloha could not, the adept said. Perhaps a test. A test, Marshal Daniel shouted. Before anyone could add their voice to the idea of a test, the main doors opened. Heads whipped around. A group of heavy-set tigers marched into the chamber. Three guards with silver helmets led the way. Each of them cradled a laser rifle. Behind them followed an impressive Lohar in a purple uniform with many medals on her chest. She had an ornate blaster on her hip, and she marched with a decided swagger. Two adepts followed behind her. They had billowing purple robes with long trailing gowns sweeping the floor. One of the purple-clad adepts stepped forward. All rise and bow before the maximum princess knee of Purple Tamaika, the emperor's third daughter-wife. Chairs scraped back as everyone rose including the ancient orange Tamika adept. The old esteemed one needed the help of two acolytes to do so. Admiral Venturi, his aides, the marshals, the captains, everyone bowed except for Ella and me. Maybe for our sakes no one seemed to notice, least of all the maximum princess knee. In the name of the emperor, rise. Princess Nee said in a voice obviously accustomed to command. Admiral Venturi settled back into his chair, as did those previously sitting at the table. The others waited from on their knees. Discreetly, Ella knelt as well. She would have made herself conspicuous otherwise. This is an honor, Venturi said. Yet I cannot understand why or how you are here. We sped here directly from the Emperor's court, the purple-clad adept said. We used a racer ship, the fastest in the fleet. Murmurs of amazement rose from the throng. There is no honor intended toward you with my presence here, Princess Ni nee said coldly. She moved closer to Venturi as the purple adept discreetly backed away. 
I have come at the Emperor's direct orders, Princess Ni said. Since you left Homeworld, there has been much debate at court concerning this mission. Soon the light of the Creator shined in our thoughts. Everyone realized that it was inconceivable a Prince of Orange to Mica should lead the great assault into hyperspace. The more the Emperor pondered the decision, the more he came to regret sending you. Orange to Mica commands the Dreadnoughts, Venturi said. Princess Ni made a sharp gesture with her right hand, chopping through the air. It is not a matter of those who man the stations. This is a case of authority, of grave peril, and the decision to see the task through with maximum chances of success. If the Emperor doubts my courage, Venturi said. It is not a matter of courage, Ni nee said. You excel in the Lohar trait. You have valor indeed, Orange Prince. Do you have battle cunning, though? Do you? Venturi asked. Maximum Princess Ni nee hissed like a wet cat. Have a care, Admiral. I am the Emperor's representative. Speak to me as if you were speaking to him. I am the Supreme Lord Admiral of the Avenging Arm of Lohar, Venturi said. The Emperor himself gave me the commission. And I am here to tell you that the Emperor has taken it away. You cannot do so while I am on my own vessel, Venturi said. You know the laws and customs of— He fell silent as the princess produced a scroll tied with a purple ribbon and stamped with a purple seal. Take this, sir, she said, stepping near and handing it to him. With a trembling hand, Venturi reached for the scroll. Then he paused. Look closely, Ni nee said. This is the Emperor's seal. I know you recognize it. Venturi's raspy tongue appeared. He seemed stricken. This cannot be. The Emperor gave Orange to Micah the commission to wander hyperspace, searching for the Jelk homeworld. That was then, and this is now, Ni nee said. But— Instead of banishing you to death, Ni nee said, the Emperor sent you into the limbo of hyperspace. Who would know that your task served the great Maker? It is amazing. Now everything rests on the operation of this combat mission. The Emperor realizes he cannot trust Orange to Mica to see it through. You are rash to speak so here on my vessel, Venturi said. I am to be the new Supreme Lord Admiral of the Hyperspace Flotilla, Ni nee said. With Orange to Mica cruise. Venturi asked. What difference does that make? Venturi stared at the scroll, still unable to take it from her paw. What is your plan of combat? You cannot ask me that, Ni nee said. Venturi's head whipped up and his eyes shined. I do ask you, he said. I was to lead us to victory and death. The Creator granted me a boon with the humans as the tip of the spear. Yes, the humans, Ni nee said, turning to me, sneering. The Emperor would find it revealing indeed to see a human sitting at the table of a strategy session. You do not obey the old ways, Venturi. You taint everything with your blindness. There are ways to die, and there are ways to live. You know neither. I stand by my question, Venturi said, and I swear by the— No, no, Ni nee said, waving her paw. I will not indulge you in dramatics. This is a simple change of command. But in order to speed the process, I will tell you that I have a completely different battle plan in mind. First, we will rid ourselves of the human scum— they will do nothing but float in hyperspace as an object lesson to the Kargs. We need the humans to complete our holy task, Venturi said. The Oracle has spoken. 
The Emperor says what and when the Oracle has spoken. You are not in primacy. Now take the scroll. You still have not told me your plan, Venturi said. Bah, Ni nee said. To take these valuable dreadnoughts and throw them away in a suicide mission is folly of the worst sort. We will await the first Karg wave, destroying them as they exit hyperspace and attempt to adjust to our space-time continuum. Madness, Venturi said. This is madness. The Kargs will bring billions of vessels. That is mere superstition, Ni nee said. Now take the scroll. You have no more options left. Sure he does, I said. I'd heard enough, and I realized it was time to act. Maybe that's why their so-called oracle had told Venturi to come and get me personally. Maximum Princess Knee turned slowly, and her garments rustled in an ominous manner. The savage actually addresses me. This is blasphemy. That's right, I address you, I said. What grounds do you have to say the Kargs lack billions? Admiral Venturi has solid proof. Silence your creature, Nee shouted, or I'll silence it for you. Commander Creed, Venturi said. Hold it, I said, standing now. I'm a Lohar ally. I am a sovereign individual. I joined this expedition to destroy the portal planet. I... Guards! Nee screamed, with her hands clenched into shaking fists. Kill it! Rid me of this orange to mica filth! The three purple-clad guards with silver helmets, the three carrying laser rifles, hurried forward. I'd heard more than enough. If the she-devil gained command of the flotilla, the Lohars would attack our commando army. While my troopers were good, I didn't think they could take on ten million tigers. Like a gunslinger from the Wild West, I drew my silver-plated forty-four magnum. With a deafening boom, I blew a hole in the first purple Lohar guard. He catapulted onto his back as smoke drifted from the barrel of my gun. I think the loud noise startled the other two guards. Besides, they were royal guards. Had they ever been in desperate action before? I doubted it. In quick succession, I blew away the other two, so they also clattered onto the floor. The Lohars watched in stunned amazement. Maximum Princess Nee snarled with rage. How dare you murder my guards! They have been with me since my commencement. You will... She didn't get to finish. Realizing that this was the Tiger Emperor's daughter-wife, I turned sideways and lifted my magnum deliberately. I had to make sure. As if at a firing range, I pumped three forty-four caliber rounds into her body. She tumbled backward, spewing chunks of lohar meat and blood, landing on her back, quite dead. The scroll landed nearby, unopened, with specks of blood soaking into it. Lowering my arm, I opened the cylinder and dumped shell casings onto the floor. Then I reloaded and snapped it shut. Things were about to get interesting. Chapter 18 I'd learned a few things about Lohars these past weeks. As physical specimens, few could match them. Maybe the energy keeping them running cost in other areas. I'm talking about mental agility. Now, tigers, like most people, had large gradations in abilities. You had smart people and dumb ones. The Lohars were the same. The maximum Princess Knee had struck me as more quick-witted than the rest. Those standing in shock in the strategy session chamber I saw as having their minds in neutral. The engine could be revving like crazy, but it wouldn't move any wheels because the gears weren't connected. I think their minds were spinning, but they couldn't articulate whatever was going on inside their gray matter. I'd just saved the mission from certain disaster. Now we could all jump into hyperspace and get ourselves killed at the portal planet. 
We might even stop the cargs while we died. Would the Lohars be grateful to the trigger-happy human? I didn't give that a high probability. In fact, the old adept would likely demand my skinning. I had a gun, but there were an awful lot of tigers in here, and I only had so many bullets. It was time to act. I had the initiative, and I planned to keep it. Stay behind me, I whispered to Ella. Then I began backing toward the door. The tigers were all staring at the dead princess. Marshal Danielle must have had good peripheral vision. Her head swiveled around in a rusty manner. She gazed at me with blank eyes. Something stirred there, though. Seeing me moving must have kicked in a basic chase instinct. With a roar, Marshal Danielle bounded at me. She literally leapt onto the table, jumped onto the floor, and charged fast and hard. I hadn't expected that. Boom! Her head disintegrated as it snapped back. Lohars were big and heavy, though. A forty-four magnum load only had so much stopping power and no more. She died, but her body kept coming, sliding across the floor at me. I sidestepped the body, and I wondered if her aides were about to charge en masse. I wouldn't be able to shoot fast enough to stop all of them. I had to think of something else to do. The Creator has spoken to me, I shouted. I didn't know what else to say that might stop them in their tracks. That did it, though. An aide that lurched toward me paused, blinking with incomprehension. I heard a tiger ask, Can the Creator speak to a human? The ancient adept took the question to heart. He bowed his head as if in prayer. In those few seconds I reached the main door. Get ready, I whispered to Ella. Even with the sagoon, she said, we'll never reach our quarters. You don't think I don't know that? I whispered. If the tigers went crazy, one hundred troopers without symbiotic armor, or even with it, would not make it back to the commando army. I opened the door. He's escaping, a different adept shouted. No, I said. I'm calling in the guard. Tigers stared at one another. They must have wondered why a human would summon the admiral's guards. This human wouldn't. I was going to summon my own. Poking my head through the door, I said into the antechamber, Princess Ni nee has demanded to see my zagoon. Troopers, hurry in here. Both human and tiger guards stared at me. The walls were soundproof, so I doubt any of them had heard the gunfire. Hurry, I shouted. My troopers understood that. They started for the doors. What of us? the Lohar senior guard asked. You are to remain vigilant, I said. Princess Ni nee spoke of your alertness. She is pleased with you. I had no idea if that would work, but it did. The senior guard stood more proudly. So did the Lohars nearest him. Meanwhile, my Zagoon, with the Zaporozhian Cossack Dmitri at their lead, marched into the strategy chamber. Do exactly what I tell you, I whispered to Dmitri. He had a crew cut, a sweeping black mustache, and wide Slavic features. He was muscular and was as tough as they came. We'd first met in Antarctica aboard a Saurian-run lander. The tigers in here were losing their shocked expressions. Maybe seeing so many armed humans among them helped speed the process. Even with my hundred, there were more of them here. They were also bigger, but not stronger, faster, nor armed. He slew the emperor's daughter-wife, the ancient esteemed one said. We all witness the terrible deed. He must die. I just saved the mission, I said. You slew in cold blood, the esteemed one declared. I laughed sourly. You didn't happen to hear Ni nee order her guards to kill me? Supreme Lord Admiral, the ancient one said. I beg you to order the human's death. Order his death the mass of acolytes shouted in perfect unison. It gave the old one's words power. 
You just killed the Maximum Princess Ni, Venturi told me. And thereby saved you a load of heartache, I said. Once again, Venturi stared at the dead princess. What was he thinking? He seemed smarter than the average tiger. That was a plus. But would it be enough? Ella sidled up to me. I hope you have a plan, Commander. This is about to get ugly. She was right, and I didn't want to go nuclear. I didn't want to poison things between our races by murdering the High Command but I couldn't see how I was going to make it back to our quarters without doing something drastic. I needed something that would hold the other Lohars at bay. The answer popped into my head. The shining globe would do it, right? It was a holy object. Yet if I held it in my grubby human's hands, that might make the tigers berserk with rage anyway. I grabbed Dimitri by the arm and dragged him beside me. With my lips an inch from his ear, I said, do you see that old tiger in the orange, shimmering robe? The one that's talking smack? I see, Dimitri growled. We're grabbing him and taking him with us. He has a holy object on his person. Make sure it stays with him. What if other tigers try to interfere with me? Dimitri asked. First push them away. If they persist, kill them. Admiral Venturi spoke up. Commander Creed. You must order your guards away. Then you must summon mine. You will lay down your weapons and await Lohar justice. I didn't want to make my play. You have to believe that. The cargs were real. The portal was real. To fight among ourselves was crazy. To let them kill me would even be stupider. Yet I had to give sweet reason a chance. Listen to me, Admiral. The Kargs are still coming through the portal. They're going to invade our universe. Are you going to let your Emperor make a foolish decision that kills everything? He besmirches the beloved Emperor, the esteemed one said. You must do your duty, he told Venturi. Wait a minute, I said. Are you serious? The purple Tamika fool sent his daughter wife to unseat you. The head tiger is a fool. Screw him and his ideas. The Lohars began to murmur in outrage. A few started shouting for my death. You have no idea what makes Lohars tick, Ella told me. You're not going to talk them out of anything. You have to impound the princess's racer vessel, I told Venturi. Then you have to complete the mission and save our space-time continuum. I must read the scroll, Venturi said in a lifeless voice. The Emperor has sent me a personal missive. Now, I shouted at my Zagoon. Let's do it. I started across the chamber for the esteemed one. Dimitri and Ella followed, and with them came my one hundred troopers. The tigers must have suspected my intentions. A few charged my men. Instead of shooting the Lohars, a shoving match ensued between them and my men. As the tigers weighed more, they had the advantage, and forced the Zagoon inward. Knock them down, I shouted. Neurofiber-enhanced speed, together with steroid-68 increased strength, caused mayhem. They were meaty, hard-hitting smacks, and Lohars sprawled onto the floor. More tigers threw themselves into the fray, charging us. This wasn't going to work. Shoot to kill! I roared. Troopers unslung carbines, leveling them into firing position. Lasers sounded with a distinct combat noise. Tigers crumpled onto the floor with smoking holes in their foreheads and chests, and that started a panic. Lohar surged away from my zagoon, giving us the opening I needed. I dashed to the head of the table and beyond, scooping up the scroll. As I did, Dimitri grabbed the old adept. My troopers surrounded the two, forcing the acolytes away. Listen to me, I roared. Listen! The Lohars were too busy shouting and cursing us. I shoved Admiral Venturi hard, so he stumbled against the nearest wall. Then I pressed the klaxon switch. It blared with noise. 
When I released it, the screaming and Lohar shouting had ceased. Tigers panted, though, watching me with hate-filled eyes. Here's how it's going to be, I said. No Lohar gave me his attention, so I jumped onto the table and I swept my forty-four at the crowd lined against the walls. They looked at me then. Good, I said. This is going to be short and sweet. Even though your emperor's bitch ordered me dead, I still consider myself allied with Orange to Micah. Defeating the Kargs trumps everything. Unfortunately, Lohar intelligence hasn't impressed me much, certainly not today. You're over-emotional and relic-crazed. Nevertheless, we can still do business together. But I need to keep you from killing me until you regain your senses. I'm taking the esteemed one with me, together with the Stone of God. Lohars wailed in anguish, and I could feel a charge building up in them, like a giant plasma cannon building up a heated shot. I fired around into the ceiling. The magnum was deafening. Bits of construction dribbled and fell in chunks onto the table. One busted apart, sprinkling smaller driblets around it. I'm a savage, remember? I shouted. If you come at me, if you try to kill my troopers, I'm going to blow apart the stone of God with my gun. Then what, huh? That got their attention. The babble died down, and the tigers stared at me with blank eyes. The evil I threatened to commit, at least in their eyes, was so terrible it probably hardly made sense to them. Admiral Venturi stepped forward. He spoke with a hoarse voice. You cannot mean such vile sacrilege. The stone is the oldest and most holy artifact in Orange to Micah possession. I scoffed. You doubt my willingness to do it? Dimitri, I said. The stocky Cossack hustled the old adept near. I implore you, Venturi said. Do not do this. I pointed at the admiral with my magnum. I want you to have the Stone of God. I'm not going to touch it. You have my word on that. After we reach the portal planet, I'll return the relic and the adept to you. You will destroy it, Venturi said, sounding desperate. As long as you treat us as allies, I will do nothing to the artifact. I'm taking the esteemed one with me so he can hold the stone. If you attack us, though, know that we will smash the Forerunner Relic and kill as many Lohars as we can. We will start by killing him, I said, pointing at the old adept. What are your final intentions? Venturi asked. They haven't changed, I said. We'll still march to the Forerunner Artifact in the Portal Planet. We'll fight with the Lohars with all our strength, battling the Kargs. The Princess threatened to kill all the humans. Do you remember? She said the Emperor gave the order. Maybe you think that seals the issue. You can bet I don't. I'm not under the Emperor's command. If he tries to kill us, I'll kill his as I've already done. I would do it again a thousand times over. Look at her body and think about that. Play fair with us, Supreme Lord Admiral, and we will play fair with you. Try to harm us, and we're going to unleash the biggest load of whoop-ass you've ever seen. Leave the esteemed one and the stone of God here, Venturi said. I will give you my word of honor that none will harm you. I considered his offer for all of a second. A glance at the glaring, hate-filled tigers told me I'd be a fool to trust anyone's word, especially as I had the one thing they held dear. I believe you, Admiral, but I don't believe them, I said. Now get out of our way. Otherwise... Do as he says, the Admiral said hoarsely. We cannot risk the Great Maker's wrath. Reluctantly, the tigers knelt, even as they glared. Then me, the esteemed one, the Stone of God, Ella, and my Zagoon began our journey back to the Commando Army's quarters. Chapter 19 
Dr. Sant insisted on joining us. He said to ensure good treatment for the esteemed one. I nodded, but told him, Stay behind us, then. We hustled through the corridors, with the adept and his stone in the center of our formation. My zagoon aimed their carbines everywhere. I wondered if I should have included gas masks in their kits. I told Dimitri in a loud voice to blow away the artifact if the Lohars gassed us. If the Tigers used listening devices, they now knew better than to try such a move. Even so, the trip was tense and nerve-wracking. Finally, we reached the monorail and piled into a car. The thing zipped along at its usual high speed. The esteemed one never said a word. He sat erect, no doubt expecting indignities at any moment. I finally told him, Look, you're going to be okay. Dr. Sant is along to see you're treated with respect. The ancient adept glared at me, but he said nothing. I wanted to ask how he liked being in the minority. Should I start talking about his extermination, as the Lohars had done in there about us? How would he like that? Probably he wouldn't understand what I was getting at, so I didn't bother. Besides, I wouldn't want to seem petty. Ella drew me down the aisle, away from the adept and from Sant. She'd already suggested I stay away from any windows. Maybe the tiger had sharpshooters out there, waiting. This will never work, she said. Do you have a better suggestion? Yes, she said. We leave the expedition and go home. Right, I said. How do you propose that? Even if they gave us a ship, they'd just blow us away the moment we moved far enough from the dreadnought. She scowled. This is a mess. I have it under control. Why do these things always happen to you, Creed? The Maximum Princess Nee started this, not me. No. The Purple Emperor did, if you want to be specific. In a way, I can see his point. The Dreadnoughts must represent a vast portion of Lohar wealth. They're also the only things that can enter hyperspace. If we're going to lose them in battle? That's not a given, I said. Do you really believe that? she asked. You gave the Lohars excellent advice back there. Use the T-missiles on the Forerunner artifact. No. In their blindness, they reject the obvious. It is always the same. I do not predict success if they can't even make the correct decisions. The T-missile did seem like a good idea, I said. Yes, she said. That is our biggest problem. The Lohars think differently from us. I think the bigger problem is that they want to kill us. I wonder why they're worried about that anyway. The Kargs are going to devour all of us in the end. This is a terrible situation, Ella said. Maybe, I said. But it was worse than Antarctica aboard the Saurian lander, and we lived through that. Ella peered at the Ancient One. Then she looked at me. I'd like to study his artifact. I stepped up and put a hand over her mouth. Angrily, she brushed it away. Listen, I said as quietly as possible. They can have the car bugged. I'm sure they do. I winked. Then I pushed her so she staggered backward. I have given my word. No one touches the stone of God but for the esteemed one. As long as I live, that is what I will do. Several of my troopers looked up at me. Ella muttered darkly and took a seat. The rest of the journey proved uneventful. We made it back to our quarters. Once there, I had a meeting with the colonels, explaining the situation. Expel all tigers from our area, I said. We will set up a patrolling roster and treat this... Well, we'll try to act like cops first. If the Lohars continue breaking in even after we escorted the first few out, we'll kill the others. Do you expect them to break in? A colonel asked. I expect everything, so I'm not surprised when it happens. This is a combat situation, with our lives at stake. I don't know if the Lohars can see reason. Maybe we should attempt to take over the Dreadnought, a different colonel said. 
We're better fighters than the Lohars, no doubt about that, I said. Unfortunately, they have over three million legionaries on this dreadnought alone. We have one hundred thousand troopers. Can each of you kill thirty tigers before they get you? Why are they acting so crazy? a colonel asked. I shrugged. I suppose every race has their own taboos. The tigers aren't any different. We're breaking them left and right. It's amazing we've gotten as far as we have. Now it's a matter of waiting and hoping logic gets through to them. We did wait for three days. We felt the bumps now and again. Each one indicated higher speeds or greater slowdowns. During that time, Ella visited the esteemed one in his holding cell. I had a camera and audio pickup pre-installed and recorded everything. Each night I watched the recording. This is what Ella did. While wearing a flowing nightgown, she came into his cell, kneeling and sitting on her heels, bowing her head and folding her hands in her lap. This was Ella? I hardly recognized her. She knelt that way for five minutes, ten, twenty, for two hours, in fact. She never said a word. She never looked up. She waited in reverence as the old adept studiously ignored her. Finally, the old one stirred. He'd been lying on his cot. Turning his head, he asked, Why do you mock me? It is not mockery she said in a soft voice. He studied her and finally stared at the ceiling again. Another hour passed. Weren't her knees sore? I couldn't have done that. Well, maybe I could have with someone holding a gun to my head. Then again, I'd already probably have tried for the gun. Clearly, Ella wanted something, and she wanted it badly. With a sigh, the old Lohar sat up. You must leave. Your presence offends me. Without a word, as demurely as possible, Ella rose and left the room. I decided to leave it alone. If I asked, she'd want to know how I knew what she'd done. She must know we had bugged his cell, though. The next day, she re-entered his cell and did the same thing. She just knelt like a virgin priestess before a holy icon. The Lohar ignored her, just like before. Time passed. Three hours before he spoke with his paws resting on his frail chest. Why do you persist in this? I wish to learn, Ella said. Learn what? he asked. How to provoke a Lohar high adept. If my presence disgusts you, tell me, please. I will leave. Yes, go, he said. Your presence hinders my meditations. She rose demurely and turned to go. That is all? he asked. With her back to him, she asked, I do not understand, esteemed one. Air hissed through his nostrils. I have watched you humans. Your commander is a rash barbarian, without any sense of decency. He is a fighting man, Ella said. Lohar fighters have greater humility and reverence for holy things than your commander does. Yes, I have seen this to be true, esteemed one. When have you? Commander Creed forced me to attend the strategy session. You were there? he asked. When you raised the stone of God. Ella's head drooped until her chin touched her chest. The radiance burned in my eyes, and it made my heart thud. Interesting, the adept said. 
I wonder if it was possible that it burned some of the human dross from your heart. Did a miracle take place? Do you believe so? she asked, and she turned, looking at him with hope. Was Ella faking this? Why would she— It struck me then. I knew what she was trying to do. She'd wanted to study the Forerunner artifact. Ella was a clever woman indeed. I hadn't realized she was this deceptive. I had not thought this possible, the adept said. Yet your actions these past days, you have acted with lohar humility. I have felt different ever since witnessing the Radiant, Ella said. Why did you don robes? It, it seemed like the right thing to do. Hmm, the lohar said, scratching his chin. Ella took a step closer. Esteemed one, could you teach me Lohar Wes? Could you teach me about the Creator and how he left these wonderful artifacts for your race? The old one stared at her. He shook his head. I do not believe that would be wise. I understand. I am unworthy for such a task. What? task is this? he asked. To teach my fellow humans the truth, Ella said. Ten long seconds passed. It seemed forever, as if he'd turned into a statue. Finally, the ancient adept stretched his arms and claws appeared at his fingertips. I will do it, he said in a lofty manner. Perhaps this is the great maker's... Well, never mind. He pointed at a spot near his cot. You will kneel and listen, and I will begin to enlighten your heart. Ella did as requested, a fierce light welling in her eyes. I wondered what she'd bring away from this. We needed more knowledge concerning forerunner artifacts. It might help us later. In any regard, Ella kept the adept busy. She had more time alone with him because I kept sending sand to Venturi. I wanted another meeting. The Supreme Admiral balked at first by always being in conference, unable to reply. Finally, at the end of the third day, Sant returned with a request. The Admiral is willing to speak with you, Sant said. We stood before a hollow image viewing port. It showed star formations I didn't recognize. One cluster near the upper left corner had different colored lights, blue, orange, and red. I'd have liked to visit there. Naturally, I'm willing to speak to him, too, I said. The Admiral asks that you come alone and unarmed, Sant said. Nope, I said. Sand faced me, looking earnest. The Admiral is insistent on those requirements for personal communication. That's nice, and I understand, for I also am insistent, but I'm insistent against his requirements. You must understand his position, Commander. Stop right there, I said. I don't have to understand anything of the sort. Tell him I'm getting nervous locked away in here. Tell him when humans get nervous, they break things. The holier the thing they can break, the better. Sant stiffened. You should not even joke about such things. You insult me, Doctor. I'm not joking. I am getting ready to... Well, I don't want to break the artifact but I am getting ready to study it. No, Sant said. That would be sacrilege. It is a Lohar artifact, particularly venerated by those of Orange Tamaika. For humans to sully the relic by their touch would lessen its sacred purity. I guess I don't see it that way. Sant's shoulders slumped. 
You disappoint me, Commander. I had hoped, but no, I will keep silent on that regard. The Admiral anticipated your stubbornness. He gave me a predetermined response. I can see you are intransient. Therefore, the Admiral is willing to come here. But he will come in state. You mean with an honor guard? Sant nodded. Wonderful, I said. When does he want to meet? Two hours from now. Sure, I said. Sant left to deliver the message. I picked a nice spacious room. It had tables, benches, water, and food. I lined the walls with two zagoons of troopers. They wore symbiotic armor, complete with helmets and grenades. At the end of the two hours, the Supreme Lord Admiral, with a retinue of three hundred honor guards, acolytes, and adepts, solemnly entered our corridors. Some of my soldiers had bagpipes. They wailed Scottish tunes on them, and the tigers looked impressed at the racket. I also wore bio-armor. If they were going to assassinate me, they'd have to at least shoot well enough to hit me in the head, as I didn't wear a helmet. Venturi's guards and acolytes had to stand in the center of the chamber. It turned out I'd barely picked a room big enough to hold everyone. Before I sit with you in conference, Venturi said, I would like to see our esteemed one. I'd anticipated that and swept my arm to the rear. Dimitri opened the door, and there stood the old and rather forlorn-looking adept. Ella stood behind him, wearing her flowing nightgown. Have they touched the stone of God? Venturi asked. The room grew deathly silent. Every Lohar leaned forward to hear the answer. No, the ancient said. They have awe regarding the relic. I... I am surprised. They esteem what should be esteemed. Admiral Venturi turned to his honor guard and to the adepts and acolytes. It is as I've said. The oracle does not lie. It told us we would gain honorable allies in the humans. They are different from us, but they are able to regard with all what should be so regarded. Dimitri closed the door, and that was all we saw of the esteemed one. Venturi sat down across from me. His aides flanked him at the table. It reminded me of old pictures I'd seen in Time magazine as a kid. On one side of a Salt II negotiating team had been large, dour Soviet delegates. On the other side of the table had sat leaner Americans. I am pleased you have treated the esteemed one with regard, Venturi told me. He carries the creator's... I groped for the right word. Stone, Venturi said. It is the great maker's stone. Thank you, Supreme Lord Admiral, I said. We stared at each other. He spoke first once again. Perhaps you have tainted me, Commander Creed. I have done a terrible deed. Yes? After much thought, I impounded the Emperor's personal race vessel. I have kept the crew quarantined from my people. I did this as you suggested so we could carry on our mission. You have done your duty to your people and to the universe, I said. You understand me, I see. Many of my highest officers do not. It is why you lead Orange to Micah and not them, I said. Yes, I believe this myself. How can I assist you? I asked. Return the esteemed one to us, Venturi said promptly. I will. Once the commando army leaves Indomitable and heads down to the portal planet. You are making this difficult. Perhaps you're right, I said. 
But could it be that the Emperor has made it difficult for both of us? He has, Venturi said. He looked away, sighed deeply, and regarded me. It cannot be as it was. You realize this, yes? How was it? I took you into our confidence. I let you into the strategy session. That can never happen again. It doesn't matter, I said. If we close the portal, I am glad, and we will have done our duty. The Lohars can never trust the humans again, Venturi said. After this is over, we will have to go to war against your world. I couldn't restrain myself at that. You already went to war against us once. No, that was to save you. Okay, I said. I can't do this your way. It's too slow and it gives me a headache. We have your stone. Are you going to stay on task and attack the portal planet? Venturi glowered but said, I am. Do you want our help closing the portal? Venturi's chest swelled and he leaned forward. You are rash, Earthman. I too can throw aside ancient customs and speak as my heart compels me. It's about time, I said. He snarled, a loud sound, and he slammed his fist onto the table. If you touch the artifact, I will return to your world before engaging the cargs. If you give it back now... I won't, I said. You get the stone once we leave your dreadnought. He glared at me, and I felt his desire to slash my face into ribbons. He rose, I rose, and our people rose with us. There is nothing left to say, Venturi told me. How about we practice our maneuvers together against the Karg menace? I asked. No, he said. I will do this without you. Is that what your oracle said? I asked. He raised his head and roared like a lion from the African veldt. It put a chill in my spine as my hand strayed to my weapon. With a trembling arm, he pointed at me. You are untrustworthy. I sense it in you, Commander Creed. But I am the Supreme Lord Admiral Venturi. I adhere to my word. On my last mission, I will not sully my honor because Earthmen cannot act with decorum. You will join in the assault once we of Orange to Mica have prepared the way on the portal planet. Don't get too puffed up, I said. We're the ones who have to go through to the end. It's not how you start a mission that counts, but whether you finish it or not. This is the last time I will speak to you face to face, he said. Sure, I said. But there's one more thing. I want you to install a viewing screen for me. We need to see the enemy in action so we can figure out what to do, and do better when the time comes. That makes no sense. Not to Aloha, I said. But you've already admitted that we're much different. Let us do things our way while you do it yours. We need to see the enemy. We need to get an idea about hyperspace. Install the screen and a communication system between our two commands. You know as well as I that we're going to have to coordinate this. Did you not just hear me? Venturi asked. I despise your face. I heard you. We won't be talking in person, so you'll be keeping your oath. Look, this isn't about us, anyway. You sought me out because the Oracle told you to. You must have done that for a reason, right? You have battle wisdom, Venturi admitted slowly. But you lack decorum. We all have to live with our faults, I said with a shrug. Venturi hesitated before saying, Let me see the esteemed one again. Nope, I said. 
Once you install the screen and communications between our command centers, then and only then can you or your representatives see him again. You guarantee to do this? I do, I said. Without another word, without a salute, Admiral Venturi headed for the door. His retinue hurried after him. As meetings went with Lohars, this had been short indeed. The next time I'd see his face again, the Kargs would be attacking. The problem was that happened far sooner than any of us anticipated. Chapter 20 In our area of Indomitable, the colonels ran their Tumens through brutal exercises. As they did, Lohar Tex linked a screen to the Dreadnought's main bridge. Several days passed in tedium. Then the terrifying announcement came. We were about to enter hyperspace. Ella had spent many long days with the esteemed one. Through him, she learned some interesting things. As we'd suspected some time ago, the first ones had made their jump routes. They had done so with their forerunner technology. The former Altair object had been one of those, at least according to the esteemed one's lore. Jump routes were like folds in space, and they allowed us newer races to zip from star system to star system without having to pay the time cost of Einsteinian physics. They also made some star systems more strategically important than others. The three dreadnoughts had used jump routes. We hardly noticed, however. Usually entering a jump point was physically hurtful. People threw up, got headaches, and felt as if they had the flu. The fantastically thick outer hulls, together with extremely bulky tech, had kept us from feeling those normal jump effects. That was a military advantage, I thought. It came at great cost, though, a literal high construction price. Through the esteemed one, Ella confirmed our suspicion that dreadnoughts cost oodles of money. The reason for the price became obvious today. Klaxons wailed, and on screen a Lohar officer informed me that we would be entering hyperspace in another hour. I'd set up a control center in the human area of the ship, similar to what I'd had on the Jelk battle jumper. Through N-7, Ella and other bridge officers, I issued orders. All but a few corridor guards were to head to their sleeping quarters and strap down. We'd heard enough about hyperspace to figure out this was going to be bad. I'd had cots installed on the main bridge for us. Time passed, more klaxons wailed, and each of us lay down. Our main screen showed what the tigers saw on their main screen. We also had a link to some of their sensors. Commander, N-7 said. He'd elected to remain at his station while the rest of us lay down. His uniform rustled as he made adjustments. My board shows a weakening of the space-time continuum at grid 24A12. You should have let Sant onto our bridge, Ella told me. There's no time for that now, I said. Besides, Sant assured us he could not take the initial hyperspace effect as well as we could. Observe, Commander. N7 said. It's beautiful. His words startled me enough that I unstrapped myself, stood, and switched my station screen to N7's panel. I don't know why he'd failed to put the image onto the main screen. A riot of colors erupted against my eyeballs. They twisted like rainbow-colored snakes in an obscenely pornographic way. I glanced at N7. The android's mouth was slack. What was going on inside his bio-brain? The colors swirled faster and faster. Then it seemed as if more rainbow snakes entered the passionate rioting. They merged and darkened to an inky blackness that blotted out stars. This must be the rip that will let us out of our universe, N7 said. My mouth turned dry. Then the darkness became complete and something sinister and vile appeared there. It seemed to be a nullity of existence, nothingness beyond even empty vacuum. It appeared to me that this was true nothing, 
if such a phrase even made sense. A hole appeared with swirling, rioting rainbow colors along the edges. Dreadnought Glory slid through the opening into hyperspace, with the second Dreadnought following. Finally, it was our turn. A fear I couldn't explain hit me, worse than any stomach-churning bogeyman feeling I'd had as a kid. Once, as a teenager, after listening to Art Bell on the radio on a show about demons, I'd had the worst nightmare of my life. I'd lain in bed, and it had felt as if a nine-foot demon hovered over me with a wavy, bladed dagger in his scaly hand. That doesn't sound so bad in the light of day, but it was as I'd lain in bed, too frozen with fear to move. I could feel that demon knife inching closer and closer to my face. My throat had locked, my lips wouldn't work, and I just about pissed in my bed. At the last moment, my mom opened the door and flicked on the lights. I thought to see swirls of inky darkness where the demon had been. Then I moved my head and looked over at my mom. I thought you had the dog in here, she said. I heard whimpering as if the dog wanted to go outside. That couldn't have been you, could it? I still couldn't have spoken, but I'd shaken my head. Good night, dear, she said. The door closed. I hadn't gone to sleep for hours, and every few minutes I'd checked where the dream demon had stood. It had been the worst nightmare ever. I'd almost forgotten the feeling. I remember now because a similar fear came upon me in waves. Was that the extent of real demons? Non-space? Non-reality? I stood there, gripping the station's edges, trembling trying to get my fear under wraps. Then a puking sickness struck. I couldn't hold on to the post. I was too busy with my arms wrapped around my gut as I spewed onto the floor. We all did. I kept vomiting. I wanted to stop. We'd never get anywhere if this continued the entire trip. Soon there was nothing left to spew. With a sweaty face, I resumed my spot at my commander's station. I glanced at a few of the people on the cots. Tears streaked their cheeks, and some had vomit stains on their chins. We're okay, I said in a weak voice. I tried to clear my throat. The fear was still too stark. Hyperspace is haunted, Rollo groaned. Yeah, I said. Nonsense, Ella whispered. You can say that after having seen the holy relic? I asked. Of course I can, she said, and she sounded angry. With the anger, strength entered her voice. Maybe that was the trick. I tried it, drumming up rage against the Lohars for nuking Earth. It helped, driving away some of the fear just as my mom flicking on the light switch that night had helped. I told the others about my find. Yes, it makes sense, Ella said. The angriest person we have is our leader. Maybe that's why the Oracle supposedly chose him. Hmm. I wonder why a similar process doesn't work for the Lohars. Different races have different reactions, I said. I want everyone to concentrate. Think about what pisses you off the most. Fixate on that. Slowly, my command team resumed their posts. Everyone scowled. I studied the screen afterward, which was black, just black, a viral nullity. Imagine spending years out here, Ella said. Why do you say that? I asked. We won't be here that long. Because that's how long the Dreadnoughts have been patrolling this region as they search for the Jelk universe. We fell silent as Lohars in the real command room began growling at each other. What are they seeing? I asked. Why do they sound worried? I'm bringing up a far scan, N7 said, and putting it on our main screen. I glanced there and in the blackness were three snowflake shapes. I had no idea how far away those things were. Do you know what they are? 
Ella asked. It clicked. I knew. And I said in a quavering voice, Those are card ships. Don't you remember seeing them in the video? Claxons rang. Are we running away? Ella asked. Negative, N7 said. It appears as if our flotilla is changing course. We're heading toward the cargs. If they are cargs, Ella said. What else would you expect to find in hyperspace? I asked. If they're cargs, Ella said, aren't they a long ways from the portal? The Lohars are firing, N7 said. I kept looking at the main screen. A gigantic laser beam flashed across the distance. Then another one joined in and one more. Each dreadnought sent a searing beam of concentrated light at the nearest Karg vessel. How big are those beams? I whispered. Larger than the biggest Jelk laser, N7 answered. The three lasers kept reaching out. They seemed to be moving slower than they should be, almost as if we watched the light move. Finally, I had a little bit of an idea on the size of the Karg vessels. The lasers burned into a tiny section of the snowflake. It would be like needle pricks sticking a bull, flea attacks. Despite the minuscule size, that piece of snowflake apparently disintegrated and crumpled. As if falling, the piece went down, down, down. The small sections of the piece turned and headed our way. What's going on? Ella asked. What are those? I said. I'm magnifying the images, N7 said. A fuzzy karg vessel leapt into view, long, with a dark energy tail spewing behind it. That the dark tail showed up against black hyperspace was interesting. Clinging to the pod were moth-like ships with glowing nuclear eyes. I don't know how else to describe them. What would have been wings on a moth, or a ship, twitched. Are those things alive? Ella asked. What? I asked. Living creatures in space? That's preposterous. No, Ella said. That would make it different from us, but it wouldn't be preposterous. Scientists have long ago foreseen space-living creatures. They must be robots, I said. Androids like N7. I cannot live in space without a suit, N7 pointed out. Well, you know what I mean, I said. Perhaps the moth ships once fed off sunlight, Ella said. The wings might be like giant solar panels. Whatever energizes them, I said. They're detaching from the pod. Twenty or more moth ships detached. They spewed a brighter colored exhaust as the vessels accelerated toward us. The dreadnought lasers switched targets, like a kid with his finger on a garden hose spraying his sister. You could actually see the last light bolt. When he switched targets, you could see the last stream of water, but with nothing else behind it. That's what it was like today, with the last stream of light. Hyperspace had different physical laws, all right. This was evidence of it. Three dreadnought lasers concentrated on one moth ship. They struck at the head with its twin eye glows, and seven magnified. The lasers chewed into the ship's hull. We saw heated sections bleed away. Then the lasers stabbed into the vessel. There might have been many explosions. Bright objects and glowing sections of ship broke apart and tumbled away as if someone had lit a firecracker in the thing, and we watched the reaction in slow motion. There was a molten core. Maybe it was the alien engine. Maybe it was the guts of a space moth. At this point, we didn't know. From the images, though, we saw the rest of the moth ships continue to bore toward the dreadnoughts. As our lasers retargeted onto a new moth ship, minuscule objects or dots appeared at the farthest edge of the screen from the cargs. The dots came from the direction of the dreadnoughts, so I assumed they were ours. I leaned forward, trying to understand what I saw. 
Fighters, N7 announced. Fifty fighters from Dreadnought Glory are attacking. That doesn't make sense, Ella said. The fighters couldn't have gotten there that fast. Our lasers... Whoa, I said, interrupting her. Is there a problem, Commander? N7 said. Our lasers must have incredibly short range in hyperspace, I said, and they fire much slower. Maybe in comparison, it's like shooting a bullet into water. The bullet won't travel nearly as far or as fast as if fired in the air. And the fighters? Ella asked. They would also be slowed, yes? I thought about that, and I might have figured it out. A bullet shot in the water travels faster than a diver can, but the differences aren't as stark as an air-shot bullet compared to a sprinter on land. The faster something goes, the more it is slowed, bringing everything down to a similar level. Ella nodded thoughtfully. You're observant, Commander. Yes, I believe you're right. I congratulate you. Before the fighters reached the moth ships, the eyes on the nearest carg vessels glowed more brilliantly. They seemed to bubble as if made of red-hot lava. Then a red ray beamed. To my eye, it traveled marginally faster than our lasers had. A single touch of the ray melted a fighter. The rest of the fighters began jinking, swerving out of the way. What kind of beam is that? I asked. What are you reading on your sensors? And Seven worked his panel. He finally looked up. It must be the graviton beam Venturi told us about. The moth ships destroyed many of the fighters. Their rays like a laser light show at an old rock concert. Fortunately, at the same time, the dreadnought lasers worked over the cargs, destroying them one by one. Ten fighters made it into particle beam range, and then we had a better estimation of the moth ship's size. Commander, N7 said, the moth ships, according to my sensors, they're a tenth the size of our dreadnought. That slammed home hard. It made the moth ships massive, bigger than anything I'd seen so far except for the dreadnoughts themselves. Now I realized each Karg snowflake vessel was many times larger than a dreadnought. Of the three original snowflake vessels, one had completely disintegrated. Yet that was a mistaken observation on my part. The snowflake ship hadn't fallen apart, but launched its component warships. Those warships were colossal pods carrying moth ships, each a tenth of the size of a Lohar dreadnought. It seemed a Karg snowflake turned into one hundred moth ships, or ten times the mass of one of our vessels. The three Karg snowflakes represented ten times our flotilla's mass. I'm guessing we can't win this battle, I said. Our lasers outrange anything they've shown so far, N7 said. That's hurting but not stopping the Kargs, Ella said. Look, another of their main warships has begun breaking up into its components. Even as we saw that, the last of the initially launched moth ships neared the dreadnoughts. I opened communications with Admiral Venturi. At least I attempted to do so. The Tiger Lord ignored me. The battle turned disastrous then as the nearest moth ships beamed glory. Those graviton rays burned through the dreadnought's electromagnetic fields in an amazingly short time. Fortunately, the last of the near moth ships died even as they began churning into Glory's hull. Admiral Venturi, I shouted, I demand your attention. If you want the Stone of God to survive... Venturi appeared on my panel. He sat in a command chair, hunched forward, with his right elbow on his knee. He looked stricken and resolved. What do you desire of me? He growled. Can we win this battle? I asked. He tightened a fist. We must, he said in a hoarse voice. Otherwise the universe is doomed. Too much struck me as odd about the battle. I was still trying to get a handle on hyperspace. Visual range must be extremely short here. I think the same holds true for radar. 
Yes, yes, Venturi said in a heavy voice. The Karg surprised us. We had no idea they patrolled so far out. Okay, I said. In hyperspace, there are short detection ranges. Therefore, if we slipped away now, we might be able to escape from the Kargs. Admiral Venturi blinked at me, as if the idea had never crossed his mind. It is possible. Yet why are the Kargs out here? If we leave, they might slip into our space-time continuum. Well, that's something that has been bothering me for a long time, I said. They need the portal planet to break into hyperspace. That would imply they don't have their own technology to do such a thing. That would mean they can't possibly break into our universe from hyperspace. Alohar, marching behind Venturi, halted, turned his head and stared at me. A muffled call caused the aide to step out of view. Meanwhile, the admiral glared at me. The portal planet will open the way into our universe. The Forerunner artifact is keyed to us. Which means I'm right about fleeing, I said. On all accounts, we must reach and close the portal. By the Great Maker, Venturi whispered. The Lohar straightened, and he began to issue terse orders. I kept the link open to listen in, and the Admiral did not close it from the other side, so I watched the progress of the battle. Our three main lasers concentrated on the second wave of approaching moth ships. Then a second swarm of tiger fighters appeared. The melee turned bloody as hell, with charred and tumbling fighters breaking apart from the slicing graviton beams. Then an enemy vessel exploded. I don't mean it burst apart in slow motion. This time, the moth ship disappeared in a titanic flash that radiated its blast outward in a perfect sphere. Two hundred Tiger fighters simply vaporized within it. Another two Karg warships also took direct hits. That left two more, which the lasers finished in short order. From farther away, more moth ships came, though. Several hundred more in an unbeatable mass. Let's get out of here, I told Venturi. It's time to scram. I don't think the tiger heard me. He was too busy rattling off orders and listening to officers' reports. I felt a bump, though. N7 and Ella swayed at their stations. We must have engaged the main engines. It seemed the Supreme Lord Admiral had some sense after all. Thirty seconds later, Venturi roared in anguish. He shot to his feet, and he spoke in a low voice. I don't know what he said, but soon we felt another bump. What are you doing? I shouted at Venturi. What's the plan? I looked at the enemy on the main screen. I think we'd slowed down. The Lohar slumped back into his command chair. Then he straightened, and there was fire in his yellow eyes. It is time to fight he told me. There are too many cargs for us to defeat. I must do my duty, Venturi rumbled. Another look at the main screen showed me Dreadnought Glory by itself, badly wounded, with a ruptured hull along its spine. Vapors billowed out of it into hyperspace. It must not have accelerated with us. Maybe it couldn't. We cannot desert glory, Venturi told me. The cargs damage the outer engines, but given time we can repair the ship. I studied the main screen. Hundreds of carg moth ships accelerated toward the stricken dreadnought. Those hundreds represented a much greater mass than our flotilla. If less than twenty moths had done that to one dreadnought, Admiral Venturi, you must listen carefully. The Lohars cannot win this head-to-head -head fight. The tiger glared at me, and he expanded his mighty chest. You do not know the Lohars. We never abandon our own. I knew that wasn't true. I'd seen Lohars flee before. Heck, I'd seen it in the strategy session chamber. 
Maybe now wasn't the best time to remind him of that. I had to use reason. No, that likely wouldn't work either. There was only one way to appeal to Venturi. I would ask you a personal question, Admiral, I said. Is this another of your insults? I am a savage and a barbarian. You've told me so more than once. But even I know where my ultimate duty lies. What are you implying? Venturi asked. We have one goal, to close the portal. If we do, our universe survives and the Lohars live. If we fail, we all perish. You can save life, Admiral Venturi, but only if you reach the portal planet. No, he said. I can do that only if I can reach the Forerunner artifact in the portal planet. For that I need Glory's legionaries. Yes, you must reach the artifact, and that will take us humans. Do you suppose I foresaw this battle? I shook my head. That would be absurd to think so. Then what caused me to insist that all the humans remain aboard Indomitable? Why, the Creator must have moved my tongue. Venturi glared at me with red-rimmed eyes. We have what we need to win, Admiral. If we all perish here, though, it's over. You must allow Glory the privilege of holding the cargs at bay while we make our escape into hyperspace. I have two more dreadnoughts to hurl into the fray. Orange to Micah will survive. You could be right, I said. Yet yeah, let us consider the odds. Forget that a fraction of their strength already did this to us. If you lose the coming battle, all is lost for our universe. If you lose Defiant in the fight, it makes our odds of battling down into the portal planet even less than before. If you lose Indomitable and Defiant survives... You have lost the humans the Oracle said you needed for success. No, Prince Venturi. You have one duty. That is to reach the portal planet and land us on it. Make our deaths in hyperspace worth something by defeating the Kargs for good. Do you realize how many Kargs will be at the planet if there are already three such Karg snowflakes out here? I hadn't thought about that. But it didn't matter now. Do you truly believe in the Creator? I asked. How dare you ask me that? I am asking. Do you? Yes, he roared, pounding the arm of his chair. Then know that he chose you for this mission for a reason. That reason wasn't to die uselessly. Maybe only you out of all the Lohars have the sense of duty strong enough to leave glory to her fate. We have our own to meet, and we can't win everything here, but we can if we win at the portal planet. I despise you, Commander Creed. I hate and loathe you to the depth of your being. That seems to be the way of things, I said. I tell the truth too often, and no one really likes to hear it. Well, what's it going to be, Admiral? The big Lohar bowed his head. I didn't envy him. It was one thing to know what to do. It was quite another to leave your friends behind to face certain death. This would weigh on his Lohar soul for the rest of his life. Admiral Venturi stood up, and he quietly issued what must have been the hardest commands of his life. Shortly I felt a bump again. We watched the main screen as the moth ships converged upon glory. Beams began to rage as we fled from the fight. We had a greater destiny than to die today. Before the stricken dreadnought perished, it faded from sight and then from the range of our short-ranged radars. There was no such thing as long-ranged radars in hyperspace. The flotilla now had two dreadnoughts instead of three. We had a little less than seven million Tiger legionaries and one-third fewer tanks, fighters, and attack craft. We also knew that the Kargs would have overwhelming numbers at the planet. The success of our mission seemed even more hopeless than before. Chapter 21
I began watching battle video like a Big Ten football coach. Sometimes N7 joined me. Sometimes L.N. Rollo sat down. We took notes, compared them, and talked late into the night. It would have been good to capture a Karg. It would have been better to get hold of their weaponry. Maybe if we could have captured several moth ships, and they turned out to be regular vessels with crews, we could have slain the Kargs. Then we could have used the moth ships as scouts. All we had were these videos of a losing space battle. So, let's see. From that, and from previous data, we could figure they had more ships, more troopers, better weapons, and already held on to the property. What did we have? We had stout hearts and determination, oh yeah. The days passed. We avoided Karg vessels. Each of them headed for the weak spot into our space-time continuum. Did that mean they had a way to break into our universe without the portal planet? If that was true, even if we closed the portal, there were going to be a ton of Kargs in our space-time continuum. I didn't like to dwell on that, though. One problem at a time was my dogma. After one lengthy session of note comparing, and after Rollo had left, Ella turned her chair around, draping her arms over the back. We were in my makeshift office and had watched the battle for the thirteenth time. I'd called thirteen my lucky number since grade school. I guess I'd already been contrary then. I recall one of my teachers telling the class to pick a number between one and one hundred. I chose thirteen. The teacher stopped the contest right then. He told us he'd met his wife at table thirteen in college, his lucky number. Anyway, I'd won the right to pen a letter to the president about something the class had done a project on. I can't remember what the letter was about, since I never wrote it. I'd won the contest, but disliked the idea of writing a letter. I'd been eleven at the time. Interested in eleven-year-old things like hide-and-seek, riding my bike, and playing sandlot football. My luck has always been a mixed bag. In any case, Ella let her arms hang down over the back of the chair. I noticed she wore a silver ring on her middle finger. It lacked a gem, being a simple band. I think we have learned all we can from the video, she said. Maybe, I said. Maybe we're missing something obvious. Do the Lochars know more about the Kargs they aren't telling us? Ella asked. In case you haven't noticed, I said, the Lohars aren't talking to me much anymore. I will have to ask Ulmuk. Who? I asked. Oh, Ella said. I shouldn't have said that. Ulmuk is the birth name of the esteemed one. A birth name sacred or something? I asked. Very much so, Ella said. A foe can use it to cast evil magic against you if they know your birth name. Wait a minute, I said. Some things aren't making sense here. First, the esteemed one has learned to trust you enough to give you that kind of info? He has. Secondly, Lohars believe in magic? Why should that surprise you? Ella asked. They believe in the Creator. You still don't? Ella cocked her head. Why would you think I've changed my mind? Ah, uh, all the time you're spending with Ulmak, I said. I'm a scientist. I study where and when I must to achieve my goal. The esteemed one holds an artifact. Have you seen it yet? Ella shook her head. Anyway, I said, magic is quite another thing than belief in the Creator. I profoundly disagree, Ella said. Both are rank superstitions. I don't get it. How can you fool the esteemed one with an attitude like that? I'm a scientist. I do what I must. I grinned. Tell me, Ella, where did you learn to play act like an acolyte? That's not something that just happens. She drew her arms up to grab the top of the chair. While biting her lower lip, a far-off look drifted into her eyes. I grew up in Siberia, she said. I remember you telling me. 
My father was Russian Orthodox. I shook my head. I didn't know what that meant. I thought you were an amateur historian, she said. One, I don't know everything. Two, what does Russian Orthodox have to do with anything? Russia became the home of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Ella said. The Byzantine Greeks sent missionaries to the Slavic tribes long ago. The Orthodox Christians also warred against the Monophysite Christians in the Middle East. The Copts in Egypt belonged to what the others thought of as a heretical set. So? I asked. When the Muslims came into Egypt, the Coptic Christians liked them better than the Orthodox priests who tried to tell them how to worship. Coptic hatred toward the Orthodox helped the Muslims overrun the land. Ella shrugged. In any case, when the Turks finally stormed Constantinople, the Russian Tsar and his priests believed that Moscow had become the third Rome. The second one used to be Constantinople. I know about that, I said. The Byzantine Empire was often called the East Roman Empire. To answer your original question, Ella said, I grew up learning Orthodox rites. Once I went to school in Moscow, I learned about the Coptic Christians, the Catholics, and Protestants. It was simply another point showing me the foolishness of belief in God. I don't see why, I said. If God is real, why would he allow all these differences? I shrugged. Not being God, I don't have any idea. But I do know that people are different. Why not different churches for different folks? Some people like doing their services one way, others another. I do not accept your theory, Ella said. People believe in magic, God, and other superstitions. The same is true for the Lohars. I fooled my father for many years, and he knew me much better than Ulmak does. It is easy to play act again in the name of science. Soon now I will see the forerunner artifact. My thoughts had already drifted from her preoccupation. I wanted to figure out how to defeat the Kargs on the portal planet. It's really crazy we're not coordinating better with the Lohars, I said. We're probably only going to have one shot to do this. We need to get it down to a science. Agreed, she said. I dimmed the lights and I turned on the machine. Ella left and I resumed watching the battle trying to find an angle, trying to figure out the cargs by how they'd fought the dreadnoughts. I woke to the sound of graviton rays. I'd fallen asleep on the cot I'd installed. I'd also looped the video some time ago so I didn't have to restart it. As I raised my head, I saw a moth ship's eyes glow like a lava pit, and then the beams burned outward. The cargs. Before I could finish my thought, N-7 entered. It is urgent, Commander. Admiral Venturi demands an immediate conference with you. Pipe it in right here, I said. No, he wants a face-to-face -face meeting. That brought my head up. You're kidding, right? Venturi swore an oath that he'd never... In my estimation, the Admiral is terrified. Something has happened to change everything. I rubbed my eyes, trying to clear my head. I needed some coffee. When and where does he want to meet? I asked. He will come to our quarters with a three-man escort. He asks you do the same. Done, I said. Do you have any idea what this is about? I do not, Commander. He is waiting outside our corridors. He desires an immediate conference. Right. Now where's some coffee? I will bring some. Ben Seven said. Don't bring that scalding stuff you drink. I need regular coffee. Ben Seven nodded briskly. You must hurry, Commander. The Admiral is urgent. I didn't like this insistence. What did it portend? Nothing good, I bet. Okay, let's go and get me the coffee. Ten minutes later, I sat at the same long table as before. I had N-7, Ella, and Rollo with me. A haunted Admiral Venturi entered the room. 
Dr. Sant had joined him together with two extremely tough-looking tiger guards. They wore orange chevrons on their collars and bronze biceps bands, showing that these had thicker arms than the others did. I sipped from a cup, black coffee that put dirt on my tongue. I still felt foggy, but with an unnatural alertness. I'm glad we can talk, Admiral, I said, rising to my feet. Venturi stopped short. His eyes were red, and if ever the tiger looked hangdog, this was the moment. The normally crisp uniform was rumpled. The military cap sat at an awkward angle, and he seemed dazed and confused. Commander Creed, he gestured helplessly. I have broken my solemn oath to meet with you here. I am forsworn and useless now. But what I have just seen and heard... He shook his head. We are doomed. We are all doomed, everything. The end has come. You mean the Kargs? I asked with urgency in my voice. Have they found us? It is much worse than that, he said. The tiger lurched and almost stumbled to his chair, collapsing into it. I sat. I'd never seen any of them like this. What had happened? Venturi produced a glass chip. The Kargs are the great enemy. It is unbelievable. The ancient writ spoke of this time, but I never realized until Abaddon spoke to us that it was so. How could any of us have known? I waited. He was obviously stricken to the core. He'd have to tell this at his own speed. All the same, I'd wish he'd hurry up for once. The raspy tongue appeared, and Venturi aimed his red-rimmed eyes at me. I must play the message. Perhaps you'll understand then. Perhaps you can. The Supreme Lord Admiral shoved the glass chip into a slot. He pressed a button, and a hollow image appeared. The Karg sent us a message, Venturi whispered. This is it. Did they beam it directly to you? I asked. The message was broad-beamed, he said. I do not think they yet know our precise location. It does not matter, though. Hello, Lohars, a gravelly voice said. The hollow image was fuzzy like bad analog TV reception. There was the outline of a possible head within the grainy fuzz. Those might have been shoulders and possibly red, glowing eyes. For a second I thought I could see, then the image distorted again. We captured your dreadnought, the one you laughably call glory, the Karg said. Some fought, as useless as the pitiful gesture proved. Let us show you their fate. The fuzzy distortion quit. I saw a lohar strapped down onto something. A knife appeared held in a metallic tentacle, and it committed unspeakable atrocities that made the tiger captive rave. Blood and gore and torn organs tossed onto the floor. It was a wretched and ugly sight. Some died even harder, mewling like wounded kittens, the Karg said in his ear-hurting voice. All provided us with limited sport, as you two will provide us when we find your pathetic ships. I now know you by name, Supreme Lord Admiral Venturi of the Avenging Arm of Lohar. You belong to Orange, to Micah, and are here to halt our invasion. That is ironic, don't you think? as your frail ship has given us the means we've sought for jumping the last lap into your space-time continuum. Is that true? I asked. No one seemed to have heard my question. They kept staring at the distorted hollow image, glued to the Karg's words. I know your mission, Lohar. It is to reach what you call the Portal Planet. Do you think you can slip past hundreds of Karg invasion torques? No. We know you, Admiral Venturi. 
We have the composition of your frail dreadnoughts imprinted on our sensors, and we will obliterate your craft on sight if you dare approach near enough to the portal. The others here have your patterns. There is no chance you will successfully land one legionnaire onto the portal planet's surface. If we find you before that, we will storm your ships, capturing you for our amusement. His words troubled me deeply. Maybe we should have stood and fought to protect glory. I hadn't foreseen this. You have one chance for life, Admiral Venturi. Come to us begging on your stomachs, and we will let you live as slaves. You will be the last to perish in your universe. Yes, you will tell us everything you know and earn your final days, or you will linger in extreme agony for untold years if you persist in your useless quest. That's important, I said. We still have things he wants. That's why he sent this message. He wants us to surrender because he's afraid. I certainly don't believe all his boasts. Venturi turned haunted eyes upon me. I had the feeling I hadn't heard the worst. Surrender to me, Lohar, for I am Abaddon. I am the bane your worlds have feared for many millennia. Venturi shuddered. So did Sand and the Tiger Guards. I have arrived at last, the Karg, calling himself a Baden, said. I seem to have heard the name before, but I couldn't place it. I have brought my multitudes with me. I have returned from the locked pit, and my wrath shall not be appeased. You cannot win. You cannot harm me. Nothing can. Surrender, Supreme Admiral, and I will teach you the meaning of power as I rend your space-time continuum into smaller and smaller pieces of death and destruction. Abaddon has spoken, and my word is a promise of destruction. Abruptly, the hollow image went blank. A second later, Admiral Venturi clicked a switch and took his glass flake from it. Who is Abaddon? N7 asked. This is a coincidence. Nothing more. Ella whispered. What is? I asked her. His name, she said. You've heard it before? I asked. It is written in the Book of Revelation, she said. Abaddon is the name of the chief demon let out of the pit. The Karg spoke about a pit, I said. Does he mean their universe? You have heard the name before? Venturi asked in shock. This is astonishing. We too know that in the last days as spoken in the ancient writ, Abaddon will reappear to bring death and destruction. His name means destroyer. I sat back, stunned. The Kargs had a leader named Abaddon, and both the Lohars and we had that name written down from long ago? This seemed a little more than coincidence to me. I recalled then walking across the old cathedral in Germany. I'd squatted beside a stone gargoyle. The statue's face had resembled cloths far too precisely. Could the Jelk have more to do with the Kargs than any of us realized it did? Okay, I said. We have to break this down one thing at a time. A couple of items strike me as important. No, no, Venturi said. Don't you understand that our mission cannot succeed? We have failed. We are doomed, and our universe will perish with us. I don't accept that, I said. We have two ships filled with soldiers. I breathe, you breathe. We're far from doomed, and the Karg's message proves it. Venturi shook his head. You are mad, Earthman. Here is the evidence before your eyes, and you cannot see. We have failed the Great Maker, and he has unleashed the great evil against us. That's one way to view it. I prefer to believe we're here to stop the evil by fighting harder than any of us ever has before. How? Venturi asked. I had one hope. To fly through cog formations, 
to use boldness to reach the portal planet. Now Abaddon has blocked the route. The Kargs know us by sight and sensor, and will destroy our ships if we get too close. I found it hard waiting for the tiger to finish talking. When he did, I said, That's point one in my reason for thinking Abaddon is bluffing. Why bother sending the message if we can't do anything to him anyway? Maybe because instead of destroying us, he wants our dreadnoughts, Ella said. Exactly, I said. Why would Abaddon want or need our paltry ships? Venturi asked. The answer is obvious, Ella said. He boasted, as Commander Creed suggests. He didn't get to Glory's core, but captured enough Lohars to have learned about hyperspace rips separate from the portal planet. Now he needs our ships intact to get the drive. Venturi sat like a statue until finally his eyes began blinking. If you are correct, he said, we must self-destruct at once. Come on, I said, exasperated. Will you listen to yourself? That makes no sense. If we fail, the portal planet will open a route into our universe anyway. He doesn't need our dreadnoughts. His fear must be that of our successfully closing the portal. That's the victory. That's the game winner here. The message has one reason and one reason only. To discourage us. Besides, did you ever stop to think that maybe there are others with him? What are you suggesting? Ella asked. I do not understand what you're saying. He broke his captured lohars, I said. We saw the evidence. Did he do that for pleasure? I don't believe it. He must have done it in order to discover what they knew. Maybe these cargs are swift-thinking bastards. In their questioning, they found the name Abaddon and his legend of the end of time. That sounds close enough to what they're doing, right? So the Karg figured I will call myself Abaddon in order to paralyze their will. Our will. Such a thing has happened before, you know. Are you mad? Venturi asked. This has never happened anywhere. We are discussing the end of everything. I mean the general principle of the thing. On our world, there was a man named Cortez. He sailed to the New World with higher technology than the Aztec Indians. Early in his march inland, he got hold of an Indian woman named Donna Marina. She told him all the Aztec legends and beliefs, and she helped him trick the Indians who had sold her into slavery. They thought Cortez was Quetzalcoatl, the legendary light-skinned god who was supposed to return out of the sea. Cortez played off the Aztec legends and thus weakened their desire to fight back against him until it was too late. Yes, Ella said. Thank you, Commander. That makes perfect sense. I think that is exactly what has happened here. The Karg acts a part by calling himself Abaddon. That makes more sense than... than the other possibility. Venturi glanced from Ella to me. I do not understand you humans. The evidence is before you. To attempt talking yourself into believing otherwise... He groped for words. No, I said. We're right. The Karg isn't Abaddon. He's using your old legend about him to weaken your resolve to fight. And if the Karg really is Abaddon, how does it help us fight him if we believe we're already doomed? I wish to add a comment, and Seven said. Go ahead, I told him. If the Karg is pretending to be Abaddon, N7 said, then why is the name in both Lohar and human holy books? Yeah, I said quietly, not liking the coincidence. That's an interesting point. No, it isn't, Ella said. Abaddon simply means destroyer. It makes perfect sense for two different supposedly holy books to talk about a destroyer obliterating the world at the end of time. This is a useless conversation, Venturi said. No matter if Abaddon is Abaddon or a pretending Karg, they have blocked the way to the portal planet. Surely hundreds of the biggest Karg vessels now ring it. They will know what to look for. Us. 
The moment they see our dreadnoughts, they will unite and overpower our paltry force. That did seem to be a problem. However, maybe we have a bit of time before that happens, I said. Explain, Venturi said. Radio transmissions can't go as far or fast in hyperspace as in our universe, I said. Maybe the Kargs at the portal planet haven't yet heard the news. Surely they have relay ships passing the information from vessel to vessel, Venturi said. I snapped my fingers. I have an idea. We can still slip onto the portal planet even if this Karg has broadcast about us. Well, we can at least slip past the patrolling Kargs. No, Venturi said. It is impossible. We are doomed. If you mean attacking the Kargs head-on, I agree with you, I said. But we're not going to do that. Instead, we'll go around and come through the portal like other Kargs. What do you mean? Venturi asked. We have hyperspace-ripping equipment, I said. So we use it to break into the Karg universe. Then we join the other Karg vessels on their side, going through the portal into hyperspace. We'll have to hope Abaddon's message hasn't gone through the portal back into their universe. As those other ships pass the planet, we unload and attack. The other Karg ships, the ones already in hyperspace, will see and destroy us anyway, N7 said. They wouldn't have any reason to do that, I said. They're watching for us to come into them, not waiting to see us come from their universe. Look, according to what Admiral Venturi originally learned, only Kargs live in their space-time continuum. If they think anything at all upon seeing us, it's that we're a new design, or an old one, for all I know. You are making blind leaps of speculation, Ella told me. Maybe, I said, but that's better than giving up. For several seconds, we all stared at each other. Finally, Admiral Venturi made a low, growling noise deep in his throat. It reminded me of an old-time muscle car on Earth, one that caused the car to shake with dog-like anticipation. You humans are mad with a hope that doesn't exist. Your wordplay means nothing. You cannot see the truth, so you foolishly persist in trying. And how is that worse than giving up and letting everything go to hell? I asked. I do not know, the Lohar admitted. Yeah, I said. Neither do I. So how about it, Prince? Let's give this bastard a run for his money. Let's fight until we're dead or lying on a cot with a carg knife spilling our guts. What I'm not going to do is stop any iota sooner than that. I begin to perceive how you defeated your Jelk overlords, Venturi muttered. Let me ask you a completely different question, I said to Venturi. I am still, he said. What? I asked. That means the prince is listening, Dr. Sant said. Oh, I said. Do you believe there's a connection between the Jelk and the Kargs? Venturi considered that. Both come from different space-time continuums. Apart from that, I do not think so. The Jelk do not possess such murderous technology as the Kargs. What are you implying? Ella asked me. I saw something in Germany, I said. Cloth looks like a devil. A small one, to be sure. A badden is a devil as well. A demon, Ella corrected. In the Bible, in any regard, the devil refers to Satan. He is one. The demons are his servants, and they are many. Sure, I said. Cloth looked like a stone gargoyle I saw in a cathedral. I'm wondering if that's just a coincidence or if it happens to mean something. I highly doubt it means anything significant, Ella said. I know your worldview doesn't want to accept such things, I said. But it doesn't even have to be supernaturally related. What if ancient men saw space travelers and wrote about them? Are you referring to Chariot of the Gods? 
Ella asked in a mocking tone. The ridiculous book scorned intelligent scientific study. I guess, I said. But suppose some of what it said actually is true. Then you could trust old eyewitness accounts written in the Old Testament or in Revelation about Abaddon or demons. You're reaching, Commander, Ella said. Enough of this, Venturi said. We must decide now what we are going to do. Either we must destroy our ships to prevent our technology from falling into enemy hands, or— No one is destroying Indomitable, I said. That is not your choice, Venturi told me. I silently counted to three, working to hold my temper. Threatening to try to storm his dreadnought wasn't going to help us. I had to convince the prince to go the last mile. If there is even one small particle of hope for victory, I said, we should take it. The Oracle told you to get us. Now you know why. We humans fight to the finish. We don't quit. Do you want it said that the Lohars lacked the fire to keep fighting when the rude Earthmen still had the guts to try? Who will say this in a destroyed universe? Venturi asked. How about the Creator when your soul stands in front of him? I asked. That made Venturi squirm. Do you guards want to quit? I asked the two tigers in back. Venturi turned around. Lord Prince, the smaller guard said. These humans insult us. Let us kill them and die with honor. Venturi's big shoulders slumped. With an old man's slowness, he regarded me. I hate you, he said in a listless voice. I do not understand you at all, but you will never march farther than a lohar. Where you go, we will go too. We will prove ourselves greater than you in all things. That's good to hear, I said and I began to outline the specifics of my idea. Chapter 22 Before we were ready to break into the Karg universe, Admiral Venturi made a few adjustments. He strengthened the link between our two command centers, making this an emergency bridge just in case the worst happened. He thus provided us a link to the interior portion of the Dreadnought. I mean, we heard Venturi talk to the priests in the sealed portion of the ship that held the artificial black hole. They spoke in the high speech of the ancients then. It meant we would have to bring Ulmak in here in order to communicate with the priests, if the time came where we needed to try. Ello spent even more time with the esteemed one. He began to show her the artifact. I figured I'd get a better look at it, too, by studying the video. That's when I discovered the equipment wouldn't record. It simply went blank whenever the adept took out the forerunner object. I was beginning to like certain aspects of this less and less. Angels, demons, and old prophecy. What did any of that have to do with space battles? Nothing, I kept telling myself. This wasn't anything what I'd expected outer space to be like. Our two-ship flotilla began to tiptoe through hyperspace, even though time was against us. We kept waiting for another broadcast from Abaddon. The devil, demon, or Karg kept silent, though. For my extended video battle-watching, I decided the moth ships were indeed structures with crews. Even with full magnification, it proved impossible to gain conclusive evidence. But some of the debris struck me to be floating crew members. What did the Kargs look like? What kind of soldiers would be face on the planet? Could they use graviton rays and rifles? That might cut through our biosuits with pathetic ease. Time passed as we trained, watched, and waited. Finally, Admiral Venturi said over the link, The technicians have found a weak spot in hyperspace. The problem is that they cannot assure me it will lead into the Karg universe. Can they give us odds? I asked. Venturi was on his bridge, and I was in mine. That is not the Lohar way, Venturi said. 
How far are we from the portal planet? At these speeds? he asked. If we rush there as fast as possible, I said. Three days' journey from here, he said. Well, let's suppose that proximity to the portal means we're near the Karg universe. Hyperspace travel does not correlate so easily. Yeah, I said. Let's do it anyway. Venturi was silent for a time. Finally, he said, Yes. In an hour we will make the attempt. Before the dread hour came, were we going to make a rip into hell? I didn't know. In any case, before the attempt, Ella walked into the control room. She didn't walk with her usual confidence. She moved in a dazed manner. I knew she'd been with Omak. Keep me posted concerning any new developments, I told N7. Then I intercepted Ella and took her by an elbow. I steered her to the hatch, walked down a corridor, and brought her into my office. Ella Timonshenko didn't say a word as she stood like a zombie. I poured her a cup of coffee, adding plenty of cream and sugar as she liked it. There were even stale pastries, a close approximation to earth norms. I chose one with a pink jelly center. She finally sat in a stuffed chair with her butt on the edge as she kept staring at the floor. Well, not staring. Her eyes were blank. I handed her the items, and she automatically took them and held them out from her body. Ella? I said gently. Hmm? She asked, while holding her stiff pose. Eat, I said. Drink, and tell me what happened. She glanced at the pastry, nibbled on the edge, and slurped coffee. After gulping the liquid, she switched gazes from the floor to me. I cannot believe what I just saw and heard, she said. With Ulmak? I asked. She nodded slowly. Well? I asked. She took a bite this time and practically gulped the pastry piece. That started her coughing, half choking. Finally, she slurped more coffee, coughed a little more, and set down both pastry and cup. The words began to gush out of her then as she spoke in a rush. I've been anticipating this moment for longer than you can believe. I have calluses on my knees, and my lower back hurts every night. The ancient one, Ulmak, is extremely condescending. He believes we're a lower order of species, possibly too stupid to understand the higher ways of Lohar. You say that as if Lohar was a person, I said. Ella nodded. Oh, yes, Lohar was the first person, as Christians, Muslims, and Jews believe Adam was the first man. Ulmok can quote pages and pages of their holy writ. It's very tedious. He waxes philosophical on everything. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to clap my hands over my ears and run out screaming. The tiger infuriates me. But I smile. I nod and listen to every word. I've been waiting for him to show me the artifact. He already has several times before this, I said. Ella's head snapped up so one of her neck bones popped. Suspicion shined in her eyes. You've been spying on the cell, she asked. Of course I have. I'd be crazy not to. Then you've seen everything, I suppose. I've seen some, I admitted. Every time he drew out the artifact, the sensors stopped recording. A slow smile spread across Ella's face. It made her prettier when she did that. Interesting, she said. She laughed before pressing her lips together as if her laughter might turn into insane shrieks. What I've witnessed today... She stared intently into my eyes. Commander, the artifact is alive. What? How is that even possible? Isn't it supposed to be thousands of years old? Nothing can live that long. I still don't know enough yet, Ella said. But I know what I heard. Maybe the Forerunner object is like N7, a construct. 
It spoke in high speech to Olmok, and he spoke to it, trying to silence the thing, I believe. It shocked the high priest when it began speaking in my presence. I think that's making Ulmak reassess some of his beliefs about us. I pursed my lips. Okay. The artifact was a thinking machine. That made better sense than it being alive did. The Jelk produced androids. The first one simply made their models more durable and long-lasting. But this all sounds interesting, I said. But why does any of this have you up in arms? Surely you jest, Ella said. I shook my head. Why, it speaks. It talks. It communicates. The object belonged to the forerunners, the first ones. That means I can ask it questions about them. I can riddle it concerning the Altair object and the portal planet. It may be the key to our victory. It certainly could be the key to unlocking our understanding about the universe. Oh, yeah. Those were interesting points. Do you really believe it's that old? I asked. What are you suggesting? Maybe someone else built it and called it Forerunner Tech. Yes, yes, that is certainly a possibility, Ella said. Yet the Lohars believe it a treasure from the distant past. Surely they must know something concerning it. This is incredible. I suppose so. No, Ella said. If you are this calm, then you do not understand its significance. This is as if the Sphinx started talking and told us about ancient times. This is scientifically exciting. I'm more interested in what it can tell us about the Altair object and the portal planet. Exactly, Ella said, and her smile became predatory. What now? I asked. Am I missing something? You, of all people, should understand the next step. I frowned, and then it hit me. You're talking about taking the artifact with us. I most certainly am, Ella said. Venturi isn't going to agree to this. He won't be alive long enough, so it matters, Ella said. You don't think we can beat the Cogs? I don't think any of the Dreadnoughts are going to survive our initial landing, provided any of us can even make it down to the planet. If the creature calling itself a Badon is right and the Cogs swarm around the planet, we're going to be lucky to get anyone down. Remember, Commander, our battle plan calls for successive waves of troopers and legionaries to secure surface area and then bore for the center. Yet we don't have enough shuttles and dropships to land seven million soldiers all at once. Yeah, I muttered. That's a problem. Klaxons began to wail, and we both knew what that meant. The time had come to jump into the Karg universe. Let's hurry, I said as I eased forward on my chair. We're going to have to use the T-missiles in some innovative manner, Ella said in a rush. My mind had already drifted onto other subjects. I stood. She stood, and we raced for the hatch. What do you want me to say? How specific should I go into what happened next? We reached the control room and lay on the cots as N-7 kept his station. Our android didn't declare the beauty of the shift out of hyperspace. Our guts did shrivel, at least mine sure did, but none of us puked that I could hear. I tell you the truth, this time we each sensed a greater feeling of dread than before. It wasn't like a demon standing over me. Instead, I felt hopelessness as waves of despair attempted to drown me in the apathy that leads to suicide. How could a space-time continuum provoke such a feeling? I heard weeping around me, and I felt dejection ten times worse. A hundred times worse than when the judge had pronounced my sentence and said I was going to prison. I had the feeling of bars clanging shut times one thousand, or like a guy's first hot girlfriend telling him she was splitting up with him. It was that ache deep in the gut welling outward with waves and waves of anguish. Yet humans are creatures of thought, not just feeling. 
Despite the weeping, the dread, the loneliness, and the uselessness of everything, I unbuckled my straps. N7 stood transfixed at his station. He stared at the screen in his panel. He said nothing, and neither did he move. I swallowed in a parched throat. Did I want to see this? No. But I was going to do it anyway. I'd once broken free of the jilt bastard cloth. I was going to beat this, too. I stood up, shuffled to my station, and studied the screen. What I saw boggled my mind. First, I saw dust as the sensors registered vast fields of gas molecules. Then I saw worlds, planets, thousands of them, hundreds of thousands, perhaps, drifting uselessly. Among them were cool black dwarf stars and neutron stars. In the far distance, I saw something much worse and more intimidating. A mighty glow of superheated matter, and it seemed to stretch everywhere, from one end of the horizon, if one could say such a thing regarding space, to the other end. Glancing at the sensors, I was startled at the radiation levels emanating from it. That thing, I whispered. I assume you mean the accretion disk, N7 said in a hollow voice. What? I asked. The incredible quantity of glowing matter is an accretion disk, N7 said. It circles an enormous supermassive black hole. My sensors say the black hole is trillions upon trillions of solar masses. I tried to understand his words. A solar mass was the amount of matter that made up the Earth's sun. Trillions upon trillions of solar masses meant an inconceivably huge amount. That meant the accretion disk, the stuff circling the black hole, must be the remnants of billions of black dwarf stars, planets, and other interstellar debris. The supermassive black hole was in the process of devouring everything. It must have been doing so for an amazingly long time. I remember reading that black holes were messy eaters, and that not all of the matter would descend into the singularity. The continual breaking down of atoms released gobs of radiation up and down the spectrum. The gravity from this universe's last supermassive black hole pulls at our dreadnought, N7 said. You can hear our engines strain. I did, and it worried me. How far are we from... it? I asked, gesturing helplessly at the horizon. Fortunately, many light years, N7 said. But the inconceivable mass makes the black hole irresistible. I thought about that. Looking at the accretion disk, the way matter went down into the center, it reminded me of the times I drained water from a bathtub. I'd watched that happen a thousand times as a kid. The last water always swirled around the drain. But in the end, all the water was sucked down and disappeared. My few words dried up. I concentrated, but I still couldn't talk. Getting angry had helped last time. I needed something different, because I couldn't even generate the resolve to get mad. I sighed deeply once, twice, three times, and felt overwhelming misery build in me. This was unnatural. Could a universe emotionally defeat someone like this? It is doing it. Instead of theory, you need action. Yeah, but I first need to believe my action can help anything. The thought put a seed of... of hope in me. If we were lucky... Heck, if the Creator really was with us, maybe we could survive. I clung to the idea... Because, I tell you the truth, I didn't have anything else. And seven, I whispered. The android moved with infinitesimal speed. It agonized me to watch his slowness. His haunted eyes finally looked up into mine. What exactly is all this? I asked. You are observing the Karg universe, 
N7 said in a monotone. Why are all these planets, dead stars, and supermassive black hole in such close proximity with each other? Indeed, N7 said. I studied the screen. We passed near a dead hulk of a planet, like hell with all its fires gone out, with giant empty pits, cold mountains, and steely ghost cities of empty buildings. And then I realized what must be the truth of this space-time continuum. If a universe expanded, think Big Bang, couldn't it contract? And if it contracted, they called it Big Crunch. Couldn't there be a time when a universe became small indeed? If that small universe still had stars and planets, matter, wouldn't they all be squeezed together like this into the last super, supermassive singularity devouring it all? I looked upon the black dwarfs, neutron stars, and the incredible black hole once more. The Kargs had to escape this place, for it was shrinking back into what? A single singularity? I wanted to shriek like a madman. I'd read stuff on the end of the universe before. Scientists and ivory tower eggheads had argued like crazy over these things. Once, people pushed Big Bang Theory hard, until they realized that implied a start to the universe. And if there was a start, who started it and put the matter there to Big Bang in the first place? Had the matter always been there? That didn't make sense. But something couldn't come from nothing. That did seem to imply a big C creator because a cause needed a reason. And for something to be there, as it is and was, there had to be a self-caused thing or being to start everything. Therefore, some scientists no longer liked the Big Bang Theory so much. Others, particularly the intelligent design guys and gals, loved it. In any case, other theories began to abound. Flat universe, open universe, and closed universe. Only in the closed universe did you have the big crunch. I don't know about other space-time continuums, but the Karg universe was as closed as could be and getting closer every second. Could it be a pocket universe? Commander, N7 said in his monotone, interrupting my thoughts. There are massive levels of X-rays, gamma rays, and other radiation striking the outer hull. We are shielded for a while, but we can remain in this universe for only a limited time until we all die from radiation poisoning. I nodded even as the desolation of this place pulled at me again. How would the Kargs manage to survive in this shrinking universe? Where could they live to outlast the radiation? That didn't matter now. Hope. We needed hope. Otherwise... I opened a wide channel with all my troopers. I spoke to them about hope. I spoke about the Creator and that we were the ones who were going to save our universe. I told them to fight doubt, fight the dejection in their hearts. We had a duty and a purpose. I didn't want them to despair. What would have happened if I hadn't gone on the horn? Let me tell you what did happen. During our short time in the Karg space-time continuum, one-third of the troopers gave in to the misery pounding at their hearts and minds. They used grenades, rifles, and knives, and did what they needed to escape the insufferable gloom closing down around them. In three words, they committed suicide. I wish they hadn't. We needed everyone. But we no longer had a full one hundred thousand soldiers, but two-thirds of our former numbers. Fortuitously for us, lucky for the universe, maybe, the Lohars didn't have that problem. Despair led Lohars to extreme indifference and lassitude. It didn't cause them to take their own lives. Look, I heard Admiral Venturi over the comm. I'm patching through to your main screen, he said. I turned to the screen. I saw the hatching of an armada and an answer to my question about where the Kargs lived. I never wanted to see something like that again. A husk of an earth-sized world floated in oblivion. It had dried seas and cold mountains 
with a flat silver area like a molten lake that had hardened. I wonder what that had been. In any case, the great breaking began on the flat silver. It split apart with lightning zigzags. That jagged line grew into a worldwide catastrophe. Mountains of debris fell away as the gigantic crack deepened, as if God used a titanic invisible chisel to break the world in two. The halves separated, and the core of the planet was cold and hollow. Out of it flew more than one hundred carg snowflake-shaped vessels. To escape the radiation, perhaps, they had burrowed into a world's cool center. Perhaps they had kept things going by feeding nuclear reactors with the core iron-nickel mass. There was nothing majestic or awesome about the spectacle. Instead, there was something vile and evil in the action. It reminded me of a black widow spider sack, one guarded by a poisonous mother. I'd watched once as a child, absorbed with the tiny hatchlings crawling out of a silk egg sack. I'd watched until my stepdad crushed the sack and the black widow with the sole of his shoe, twisting his foot back and forth. A hard smack to the back of my head and a stern lecture taught me why I shouldn't have been bent over like that watching. You kill black widows whenever you can, my stepdad had told me. It had been one of his few useful lessons. The cog vessels are accelerating, Venturi said. I will follow them at a discreet distance. Right, I said. They must be heading for the portal. I am of a similar opinion, Venturi said. For the next several hours we followed the cargs. Another burnt-out planet burst apart, and more giant snowflake-shaped vessels headed in the same direction, like a horde of lemmings. Only these were fantastically massive ships instead of rodents. And these lemmings didn't head for a cliff to dive into the ocean and oblivion. The fleets headed for a portal that would give them life and endless combat in a new, fresh universe. Their numbers were staggering. I was witnessing thousands of ships, masses that should never exist. How many vessels would it take to conquer a galaxy? Two galaxies, or three, four, or more? While I was witnessing the recruiting ground or recruiting space-time continuum for such a campaign. Sure, it would take the Kargs a million years to get the job done, but they would be starting with our spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy. Admiral, you might need to jump to the head of the line, I said. I have reached a similar conclusion, Venturi said. Seconds later, there came a bump, and then another and another as the dreadnought increased velocity. The gas molecules and dust made our shield red with energy. That was bad. If the dreadnought's electromagnetic field overloaded... I suggest you get your troopers ready, Venturi said. Do you see the portal? I asked. Not yet, he said. But if this universe is shrunken to this tiny area, I doubt the portal will be far from here. Look at the masses of ships. I observed the big screen, and there were tens of thousands of enemy starships in long lines, all heading inward toward the portal, presumably. The inner misery threatened to return in my heart. I shook my head. I refused to give up. I never had yet. Why begin now, here, in this infernal pit of a universe? Yeah, it was time to get ready. Time to don a symbiotic suit, check my rifle, and make sure I had a ton of grenades ready. Time to talk to my colonels and number off. Seeing these carg ships, I imagined that the portal planets swarmed with vessels the way ants swarm an open jar of honey. The only good I could see from this would be that the new carg ships would push the others away to make room for more, more, more. It also showed me there was only going to be one attack wave for us the first one. That meant loading each transport and dropship with three times the regular numbers. Every inch of each aisle would be crammed with troopers. Even that probably wasn't going to be enough. During the next few hours, I found out that I was wrong. The colonels soon informed me of the many suicides. 
By tripling the numbers in the drop boats, I could now take every human left alive on the dreadnought. I worked hard, cajoling, pleading, shouting, and slapping endless backs. Halfway through the proceeding, Venturi informed us he saw the portal. A ragged cheer went up as I oversaw troopers. Let's load up the boats, I said. Once we're back in a hyperspace, I don't think we're going to have much time but to race into combat. Work helped keep me from despairing. The biosuit also helped. Had Cloth known about this universe and its effect on humans? Had his scientists done things to the symbiotic suits that allowed us this extra margin? Had his reason for coming to Earth been different from what he'd told us? Maybe the Lohars had known more than they told us, too. Bloody aliens. There was nothing good about them opening our eyes to the greater universe. Everything I'd seen had brought more heartache. None of this had solved our problems, as some believed extraterrestrials would do for mankind. The uploading became a madhouse. There were massed body jams in the corridors. The hangar bays were a giant mob of shouting, pushing troopers cramming themselves into the dropships. This place tore down our discipline. I shoved my way aboard with my zagoon with me. I was still linked to the Admiral. Well, are we near? I asked him. Commander Creed, Venturi said. I wish to state for the lore masters that you are a unique individual. I find you loathsome, yet filled with courage and a Lohar's heart. The Oracle was right to summon you. Soon we shall pass through the portal. I do not believe I will live once we begin the landings. Come with us, I said. Join the surface attack. I cannot, Venturi said. I am the Admiral. I know you play by the rules. And normally, for you at least, that's good. Why not change the rules this time? No, he said in a stern voice. I am the Supreme Lord Admiral. With the authority comes responsibility. Alohar knows this. I will fight from the bridge where I belong. I refuse to desert my post and give my duty to another. You're a tough Lohar, sir, I said. I am sending Dr. Sant to you. In fact, I believe he has already boarded one of your assault boats. We welcome him, I said. Admiral, there is something else. If you will permit me, I have a few battle suggestions. I am still, Venturi said. I wasn't, as a mob almost shoved me off my feet. I felt elbows jab my back and the toes of boots kick my calves. I pushed back even as I spoke. Look, I know you hate the T-missiles. No, that isn't right. You hated my first suggestion. Now I think you should use them to pepper the inside of the portal planet. If there are cargs inside waiting for us, you need to pop those thermonuclear warheads amongst them. Try to create a lane for us to the Forerunner artifact. Yes, that is a wise suggestion, Venturi said. Another thing, I said. But it's going to sound heartless. Speak. You've seen the Karg numbers. It's crazy. Overload your landers with legionaries. You're only going to get one wave down there. Use that to get as many legions down as you can. Once you've done that, I'm sure the Kargs are going to turn every graviton ray in range on your ship. I will attack them with ferocity, Venturi said. You could, but I wouldn't. You risk disablement and capture that way. We can't afford having the Kargs get your universe-ripping equipment. With all that said, you can also aid us in a better manner. How? he asked. Once our first assault wave is in space, I said, you need to build up as great a speed as possible with those dreadnoughts. Then you need to ram the planet as close to our landing zones as possible. Fire nukes as you go down, but use the giant ships to wipe out two vast areas. That might give us a little more time to burrow into the world and start the journey down. You are heartless, Venturi said. I didn't think you'd like the idea. No, he said. It is brilliant. 
But if I do this, Commander Creed, you must swear to me that you will make it to the Forerunner artifact and cause it to go elsewhere. I'm going to try my damnedest, I said. No, he said. I want you to swear you will succeed. I can't know that. Swear it, Commander Creed. Let me know that my sacrifice will be for a higher purpose. Swear it, Ella told me. I hadn't realized she was here. She clutched an ammo bag against her suited chest. She must have filled it to capacity because it kept moving, squirming. I frowned at her. Commander Creed, Venturi said over my helmet comm. Okay, I said in a grim voice. I'm going to swear to you, Prince Admiral Venturi of Orange to Micah of the Avenging Arm of Lohar. I will swear with all my heart to battle down to the Forerunner artifact and make it go where no man has gone before. By the Great Maker, swear it, Venturi said. Sorry, I said. I can't do that. You do not believe in him. I do, I said. But I believe it's wrong to swear by his name. Ah, Venturi said. Thank you, Commander. Thank you. We Lohars also believe that. Now I know the Oracle chose wisely. The portal approaches. I have never wanted to leave a place more than this forsaken universe. Too many Kargs have already made it through. But so many more are coming. It will be a pleasure besting these foul creatures. Yeah, I whispered. The fun was about to begin. Chapter 23 This was my Battle of Armageddon, Phase 1. It was terrible and glorious. It was sick, mad, lovely, awe-inspiring, and gut-wrenching, as only commandos and dirt-grubbing infantrymen riding landing craft can understand. Each era of war has its bloody hazards. Who is to say which is the worst? Imagine marching in a line with your buddies during World War I across no man's land. Machine gun fire mows down hundreds on your side so they topple like trees. Artillery shells knock down even more. Then you have to crawl through enemy barbed wire where you hang like a fool until you die, torn by shrapnel. Or imagine yourself with a sword in hand during the Third Punic War against Carthage as you charge the city wall. You reach a siege ladder and scramble up as the defenders pour boiling oil on your head and your skin melts from your face. War. What is it good for? Well, it's good for businessmen making munitions. It's good for dirty politicians who need people to think about something else. It also helps getting rid of bastards and evil empires. Sometimes it can even save your space-time continuum. Crammed to the gills, our assault boat lifted off the hangar floor. The engines thrummed so the deck plate vibrated against our boots, a good sound and feeling. We were done with our puking due to re-entering hyperspace. The grim despair had departed, and that was a fantastic relief. Power up, I said, and the outer boat camera showed us what went on around the vessel. I put that on the dropship's main screen in front, as if it was an airplane movie. Ella sat beside me on a crash seat. Other troopers sat at our feet, and a few more were in front. The rest of the extras jammed into the aisles. The boat was still in the belly of Indomitable. Well, the landing craft wasn't in the belly exactly, but in one of the huge hangar bays, as I've said. A collective ah filled the assault boat. On the screen we saw hundreds of other dropships like ours. Each was a sleek armored tube with landing skids, a big exhaust port, and sides ready to explode open. We used a rugged Lohar boat, with an orange to mica sword emblem blazoned on the sides. Taken all together, our hangar bay held half the Earthmen ready to rock and roll against the Kargs. Switching to an outer scan, our pilot, N7, said, They shouldn't have done that. 
the good cheer evaporated. I could feel morale drop like lead in a lake. First we saw Defiant. Then we saw giant Karg snowflake ships. I'd say there were twenty of them between the great metallic planet below and us. Our two-vessel flotilla had pulled away from the stream of ships exiting the portal every few minutes. One thing that helped slow the flow was the size of the portal. A giant Karg ship couldn't fit through. It meant the snowflake-shaped craft split into component moth ships, zipped through and reformed on the other side. We could barely make out the portal and a last glimpse of the Hell Universe on the other side. None of us looked there long. As our two dreadnoughts nudged out of line and moved toward the metallic planet, the Karg vessels in our way began to disintegrate. The moth ships, the fighting vessels, were getting ready to engage us, was my feeling. I'd come to appreciate what the Kargs did with their moth ships. The Snowflake vessel had a skeleton and a vast engine. I imagine all the moth ships, once docked on the skeleton, added their power to the thrusters. That gave the Snowflake vessel its greater motive energy. Once the moth ships detached, I suspect they had slower rates of acceleration and burned up fuel faster. Why otherwise fly linked together like that? More Karg superships between the planet and us began breaking down into the smaller moth ships. A few already turned to face us. Oh, boy, I muttered. It looks like the welcoming committee is on the ball. Commander Creed, my headphones said. I wore a helmet. We all did in here. Admiral Venturi was on the line. I chinned my comm unit. I'm right here. We will offload you now, Venturi said. There are some Karg vessels between us and the planet, I said. Yes, Venturi said. Good luck, Commander Creed. Remember your oath to me. I haven't forgotten. I pray the great Maker grants you victory. Roger that, I said. As we spoke, the Lohars began the attack. They'd learned one trick from me. When working for Cloth and the Sigma Draconis attack, we assault troopers had stormed a Lohar planetary defense station. In it, we'd found a teleportation missile. After gutting the thermonuclear warhead, we'd teleported straight out of the PDS into Cloth's flagship. We hadn't launched the missile first to fly in space. Instead of launching the T-missiles outside of the dreadnoughts, the Lohars launched them from within, indomitable and defiant. Even as the dropships began to disgorge from the giant hangar bay, the first T-missile left the dreadnought. I watched on our main screen. I imagine we all did. There was nothing else to do except worry, and that wasn't any fun. T-missiles began materializing among the disintegrating snowflake vessels. Seconds later, massive thermonuclear explosions made our presence fully known. Cheers erupted in our boat, and I realized I shouted the loudest of all. We pumped our fists in the air. The Lohars and Earthmen are among you, I roared. It's time for you to fear. Our dropship passed through the huge hatch, leaving the hangar bay for good as we accelerated directly for the atomic flowers blossoming into existence. A nifty byproduct of teleporting nukes was that if one timed it right, one could send them in one right after another. The first warhead didn't destroy the next one because it wasn't there yet, and the EMP blast had already washed the area and moved on when the next warhead finally did materialize. Admiral Venturi did the opposite of encroaching artillery fire. In ground combat, there's a dangerous way to help masses of troops attack the enemy. That's to have the artillery shells walk toward the enemy line. As those shells fall closer and closer, friendly troops follow. It had to be done perfectly, though. And that took lots of training or many battles to learn how to get it right because what often happened was friendly shells fell on friendly advancing troops, and that made infantry bloody angry. Here Venturi started close to us and had the T-missiles appear farther and farther out as the dropships headed for the portal planet. 
This was called running the gauntlet in the worst possible way. The T-missiles killed many Karg moth ships in our flight path, but didn't get all of them. The survivors started beaming our assault boats. That was the right move for them. Even as we drove in, stubby Lohar fighters accelerated ahead of us. They engaged their particle beams from too far out, probably to get the enemy's attention. A few of the fighters carried missiles, launching them at the moth ships. I had a feeling what it must have been like during D-Day onto the Normandy coast of German-occupied France. Screaming shells, spouts of cold ocean water soaking you, and the terrible rocking of the landing craft, making you spew because of seasickness. This was better, and this was worse. We didn't rock. We watched the bigger battle, and we couldn't do a damn thing about it. Troopers began shouting with rage. I'd let them. They had to let out steam somehow. Better to rave than to despair. Lohar fighters flew to their doom, taking the battle to the moth ships. If the cargs ignored them, the fighters pumped particle streams into the giant ships. If the red rays destroyed fighters with pathetic ease, that at least meant for the moment the enemy left the assault boats alone. Only one thing counted in this battle. Us getting to the center of the planet. Indomitable's heavy laser and their host of short-range particle beams now came into play. This was like a giant game of chicken, with two sides roaring at each other, and with riders blazing shotgun blasts and rifle fire at the enemy. There wasn't much finesse, unless you figured drawing a knife and shoving your arm down a roaring lion's throat to get to his heart as crafty tactics. We advanced. We died. Fighters died. Moth ships died, and the two mighty dreadnoughts accelerated. As we did all this, hopefully materializing T-missiles into the metal planet, carg ships began converging on the two main interlopers. Our trick of coming through the portal behind the planet had worked for the moment. We'd gained initial surprise and a chance to offload. Now, however, the alien carg vessels focused beams onto the dreadnoughts. This fire didn't only come from the ships between the Lohars and the planet, but from behind them, from those enemy ships coming through the portal. Our drop ships sped for the surface. We hadn't even reached the atmosphere yet. I gripped the armrests of my crash seat, and I saw an unholy thing. Red beams of tremendous size cut into Defiant. They gored the mighty vessel. They poured heat and destruction into the ship as more rays added their power. The electromagnetic field hadn't stood up long against the annihilating graviton beams. The armored hull lasted slightly longer, taking horrible punishment. Heated globs of metal floated everywhere. What if the dreadnought blows? Ella asked me. I thought about an exploding moth ship the first battle. It had wiped out one hundred fighters like a man swatting a mosquito. The Defiant didn't blow. The Rhode Island-sized vessel cracked apart as red glowing sections fell away. The graviton rays acted like slicing knives. Here a slice, there a slice, everywhere a slice, slice. As fury bubbled in my gut, I stood and shook my fists at the cargs. It meant nothing to the battle, but it helped my raving heart. A crackle of sound brought me around. Commander Creed, I heard through static. This is Creed, I said, slouching back into my crash seat, snapping the buckles back into place. We are about to rush for the planet, Venturi said. Give them hell, Prince, I said. No, I will give them a defeat, the Lohar said. There are too many of them, but you have faced too many enemies before and still won the battle. That's true, I said. Even if we close this portal, I wonder if our space-time continuum can defeat these far too numerous cargs that have escaped their universe. That's not our problem, Admiral. Our purpose is to give our universe a fighting chance. Yes, I believe this too. We are in agreement, I said. 
We are in agreement, Venturi said. I am still, I said. May the great maker bless you, Commander Creed. And you, sir. Those were the last words I heard from the Admiral Prince Venturi. If you can believe it, I felt as if I'd missed the old tiger. He was all right. He was a man's man, even if he was a lohar. He knew how to finish his life in a blaze of glory. I admired that. The accelerating dreadnought, the last of its kind, soon sped past our swarm of assault boats. Karg moths beamed the giant vessel, and they brought down the protecting shield. They tore up hull armor. In return, Lohar lasers killed two moth ships, and the great vessel from our universe smashed against three Karg craft. Then the colossal ship glowed fiery red as it entered the portal planet's atmosphere. I wondered if they had managed to pump T-missiles into the thing. I laughed wildly, realizing I witnessed one of the greatest charges in history. Indomitable went down like a blazing meteor, accelerating the entire time. It left a fiery tail as it plunged down, down. Then the great starship struck the portal planet. I would have liked to hear the clang like a gong of doom from our universe to theirs. Did the planet wobble? I couldn't tell. A vast dent appeared, but I didn't see that either. And Seven told us about it. A giant mass of metal, plastics, water, bodies, and other material flattened, exploded, burst into fire, and did other contortions before billowing upward in a great mushroom. Strike one, I shouted. Are we strike two? Rollo asked from behind. If we can get down and burrow under the surface in time, yes, I said. What is strike three? he asked. I turned to Ella. That is an extra ammo you're holding, is it? She shook her helmeted head. You have the forerunner artifact, I said. I do, she whispered. Did the esteemed one willingly give it to you? She sat silently, hugging the bag tighter against her chest. We all do bad things. We're all human, right? No one is perfect. Maybe there's a time to murder the innocent. I'm not saying that's what Ella did to Ulmak. Ella wasn't talking about it, and there was a guilty feel to her. I'm glad she had the artifact, however she'd gotten the thing. Ulmak was dead now, anyway. Would it have been better for Ella to leave the little relic behind? I didn't think so. I jerked a thumb at Ella. Our scientist has a tool that might come in handy for strike three, I said. Of course, we're going to have to make it down onto the planet first. The cargs are converging on us, N7 radioed. Give me a snapshot of it, I said. On the dropship's main screen, I saw giant snowflakes to the side of us turning our way. Whatever we were going to do, we would have to do fast. How much longer until impact? I asked N7. ETA ten minutes, the android said. Will the debris from the dreadnought have settled enough? Ella asked. We are not going to land there, N7 said, but beside the radius of destruction. Like a vast swarm of bees, the lead invasion craft entered the atmosphere with our assault boats in the center. The air was a blue-green methane mix, and it created hot yellow flares as the first dropship smashed into the upper levels. Then the rocking and shaking started for us. It threw those on the floor and in the aisles all over the place. I'm getting a message, N7 said over my headphones. From the cargs? I asked. Yes, Commander, N7 said. From the Great Abaddon? Yes, Commander. I'd been waiting for that. Patch him through to me, I said. But just me. We don't need to give him an opportunity to demoralize us. Are you sure that is wise? N7 said. What are you thinking? Spill it. Maybe the Kargs have technology to know who hears the message. 
If so, they will discover who our leader is. Good point, I said. Here's what you do. Reroute it to one of the Lohars. Make sure it's the captain of the most damaged fighter left. And Seven followed my orders. Meanwhile, the shaking, the screaming sound of metal with building heat buffeted us and rattled our teeth. Anything? I asked N7. Observe, he said. Put it on my HUD, I said. I have. I watched as a seeking red ray switched from the human assault boats to an outer Lohar fighter, one of the few left. The beam stabbed the fighter, destroying it in an instant. Once done, the graviton beam began torching Lohar assault boats. Was that the ship that received Abaddon's message? I asked. Yes, Commander. We haven't figured out all their tech yet, that's for sure, I said. Do you know how he knew? No, N7 said. The shaking became too much then. I clung to the armrests and lay my head back. The entire dropship slung from one side to the next. We went up and down. I was hardened from entering hyperspace, though. It did nothing to upset my veteran stomach. Who had made this portal planet? The Forerunners, right? Why had they bothered? Did it have anything to do with the Kargs? I would bet yes. Had the First Ones forced the Kargs into the strange space-time continuum? Why would they have done so? And had the eerie universe already been on the brink of destruction back then? Or did time flow much faster there than our cosmos? I had questions and few answers. Yet now we had an artifact from that era. I wondered if Ella could speak to it. She said it spoke high speech. None of us knew it, just Lohar adepts. Most of them were dead, or would be very shortly. I urge everyone to hang on. N7 said. We are taking evasive action. What? I shouted. Why? What's going on? There are planetary cannons, N7 said. As he spoke, our assault boat flipped, and it hailed troopers down onto those strapped in their crash seats. The next few minutes became a jumble of confusion. I couldn't focus on the screen anymore. I dodged unsecured troopers. I grunted at heavy impacts. Bringing the extra soldiers might have been a mistake. Some broke limbs. Worse, they did the same to those buckled in. Without the symbiotic suits, many of the crash victims would have died. Because of the bio-armor, those with broken limbs could still function, the suits applying extra stability for the broken or cracked bone. N7 leveled out, and I heard groans and saw troopers squirm in agony. The boat's shaking continued. We dropped through green clouds. A massive something sped past us, heading into space. That was an enemy shell, N7 informed us. The shaking and rattling became worse. Small pink clouds now appeared for no good reason. I took those to be exploding anti-dropship shells, like flak. Metal rattled against us. Three pieces tore through, killing a trooper. The wind shrieked, and then we dropped almost straight down. It made my gut flip, and I clawed at the armrests. On the screen I saw another drop ship, and I saw something reach up from the planet. The thing exploded, and there was a white and pink fog of vapor and hot smoke. I watched for another second. The other assault boat was gone. Landing in ten seconds. N7 said in his cool android voice. On the surface I saw pleochroic domes. They shifted with a bewildering array of brilliant greens, blues, reds, and purples. Through the brightness I realized they were great metallic hemispheres with giant gun barrels sticking out of them. They boomed, sending hardware into the sky. Another dropship disappeared in a pink cloud. I felt like a rat on the Titanic. The domes dwarfed our boats. So did the planetary cannon tubes. Get ready for impact, N7 said. 
I did, and like an out-of-control helicopter, our androids smashed against the metallic ground. We skipped, hit down again, skipped again, and spun like a careening bumper car. Then we slid with a shrieking sound of metal. At last, the dropship came to a halt. I panted in my seat, trying to get my eyes to focus right. Then the sides of the craft blasted open. I watched a section of detached hull tumble end over end. It finally struck the ground and skipped across the metallic surface. The heavily methane mix rushed in. That killed three troopers who hadn't sealed their helmets properly. Stupidity was a bad way to die. I wanted to kick their butts, but it was too late for that. Besides, I didn't have time to worry about the dead. We'd reached the portal planet, or its surface at least. Now we had to get to the center before the cargs could kill us. Chapter 24 The atmosphere was alien, with milky threads drifting like rivers of smoke. Illumination came from atomic fires raging in the distance. Giant red beams stabbed down from space, and areas of the metal planet composed of a pleochroic substance shimmered with eldritch lights. Too many troopers never made it out of the dropship. It would have been good to set up a hospital area for the badly wounded. I stopped then, staring at a gun dome three times bigger than any football stadium I'd seen. The boom would have been deafening without a helmet to dampen some of the noise. The concussion of sound hit like a wall, staggering me backward. I stopped because I had no idea where Jennifer was. She hadn't made it to my assault boat. I'd had far too little time for her lately. In fact, we'd grown apart. It was unconscionable that I didn't know where she was, but I didn't. Maybe that made me a heartless bastard. Maybe it meant I was on a mission to save our universe and nothing else mattered. Not even my shattered love life or the life of the woman I loved. More assault boats landed. Even more crashed and crumpled with a scream of metal. They leaked blood and gore, and the losses sickened me. I couldn't think straight with the continuous roar of the planetary cannons, the sounds like waves pushing against our bodies, the flashes of intense light. We have to get down before we can count off, I shouted. Down where exactly? Ella asked me. I pointed at a radiant planetary cannon dome. I labeled it the PCD. The giant tube sticking out of the opening belched orange fire and spewed a heavy projectile. The firing tube recoiled out of sight into the dome. Then it reappeared as blue smoke curled from the mighty orifice. We break into one of those structures and kill the cargs, I said. And if the domes are automated? Ella asked. Let's find out, I said, starting for the nearest one. A trooper grabbed my arm, stopping me. I whipped around to see Rollo. We can't just charge in, he said. We need a plan. I laughed crazily. This isn't a solo mission, he shouted. You aren't just charging a Saurian lander this time. This is a planet, Creed. I've always been a follow-me type leader, I shouted back. I ripped my arm out of his grip. Transmitting on a wide channel, I said, Listen up, you grunts. We're going to take that dome. I raised my arm, waved it, and pointed at the huge metal thing. We don't have much time. The cargs upstairs are going to start beaming down with greater precision and killing more of us. At least I would in their place. That means we have to act like gophers as fast as we can. Find your sergeants, find your zagoons, then follow me and kill everything that doesn't look like us. I took a step forward before spinning around. Ella! Here, she said. Like everyone else, she was black with her symbiotic suit. She wore an air converter, a bulky ammo pack, had a Bankouv laser rifle, old-style gel grenades, and the most important thing of all, the little forerunner artifact clutched against her chest. You stick to me, I told her. 
That thing you're carrying is probably the only way we're going to win. Roger, she said. I mean stick tight, I said. Yes, Commander, she said. I understand. Amid the landing boats, the hail and clang of others, we started for the nearest gun dome. The gravity struck me as slightly more than Earth norm. We could easily move in it, as we were stronger and many times faster than normal humans were. Our Lohar allies landed, and would continue to land for the next few minutes. They would come down in a circular circumference around us for at least one hundred kilometers in width. They were the outer shell. The humans were the inner. This arrangement was part of the plan. Would a Karg Admiral noticing this decide the inner part was the bullseye? I'm guessing that was more than likely. I wanted to make this hand-to-hand -hand combat as quickly as I could. The Kargs had the heavy hardware with their spaceships acting like orbital platforms. They had infinitely more numbers, too. Were they any good at face-to-face -face fighting? The landscape was eerie, stark with giant metal towers and the brilliantly lit PCDs, lonely as all get-out. There weren't any stars up there. There sure wasn't any sun. There were Kargs, though. Fiends, maybe. Deadly aliens, for sure. I shook my head. Lohar tanks wouldn't have a chance on the surface. All our plans went out the window as far as I could see. We had to be commandos indeed. I had the one ring, the orange Tamika forerunner object, and the center of the planet was the crack of Mount Doom. Wasn't that funny? Venturi and I had made all these plans of moving big armies. We played sandbox general for weeks. Ten million Lohars advancing, holding, deepening the pit, and then bring in the drill that were the human assault troopers. Instead, our strategy was shot to hell with a portal planet swarming with ten thousand Karg space vessels or more. All they had to do was beam wherever we landed, and soon all of us would be cooked, crisped corpses, smoking like hot pork. The giant dome came into better relief. Were there doors in that thing? Hatches? If there wasn't a way in... Bingo, I saw one. Look at that circular hatch, I said over the open channel. Dimitri, Rollo, do either of you see it? I do. Dimitri said. Blow it down, I said. I'm not sure how many troopers Dimitri had of his Ming'an, maybe two-thirds, maybe half, meaning seven hundred fifty to five hundred troopers. Three squads set up portable plasma cannons on their tripods. Seconds later, the first heated orange blob splashed the big metal hatch. Here was the test, eh? Would our firepower prove good enough to crush Forerunner construction? The answer proved to be a resounding yes. The first shot created a breach, the second opened it wider with glowing hot edges, and the third made room for us to jump through it. I'd expected darkness inside. Instead, I saw yet more intense brightness, and my visor polarized deeper to compensate. A few swift glances around me showed I had something like four Mingons worth of troopers. That meant four thousand tough guys from Earth. Was that enough to clear out one of the giant domes? We were about to find out. A regular Mingon led by Demetrius charged through the opening first. In seconds, radio chatter told me the closest halls and corridors proved empty. Then the cargs in there struck, and the first gun battle with their infantry began. They fought savagely, as you'd expect fiends to. They should have slaughtered Demetrius's Mingon, right? Wrong, my friend. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We were on a mission from the Oracle. It had told the Lohars to get us for this assignment, and it must have done so for a reason. I learned several things fast. One, the big dome had decks, levels, turning this into a three-dimensional battle. That made it like old-time PDS fighting in the Sigma Draconis system. That brought back memories and ideas. I started acting like a general again. Ella spread out a computer scroll for me. I already stood inside the gun dome, giving orders. 
Dmitri to the left, Rollo to the right. Climb, go down, encircle, and fire from all sides. Demetrius dug in. Well, he couldn't do that in metal. But he and his troopers held their locations while Rollo, Dmitri, and Ms. Chan, the last Mingan commander, followed my orders. Once they engaged in a fight, the Kargs didn't know how to react. Just charged harder than Lohars would have done. That helped. I've spoken about suicidal troops before. They bled too hard compared to soldiers who wanted to live for another day. With high-tech weaponry, caution usually saved lives. It might have helped that we had heavier personal weaponry. I saw a Karg infantry creature soon enough. So maybe I ought to let you know what they were like. I don't know that I'd call them robots. I don't know enough to make the call. These things seemed built and grown, though. A Karg, or a Karg soldier, had a barrel body with a horny shell like a beetle. He had a triangular head with the same tough substance and complex eyes like a common earth housefly. He had a wet orifice for a mouth with chitin teeth. And if you can believe it, he had two metallic tentacles with metal pinchers on the end. We'd seen such a tentacle before, holding a knife that had sliced a strap down Lohar. A karg had three shorter tentacles on the bottom for mobility, scuttling from place to place. He spoke in clicks. So I had no idea how the Abaddon character had spoken to us. That made me wonder if these were designed cannon fodder types. I guess they could breathe in this atmosphere. The Kargs didn't have graviton ray infantry weaponry. That was encouraging for our side. They had rifles with odd shapes, sizes, and big calibers like riot guns. In the beginning, I didn't see what made the weapons fire. I'm talking about hammers striking pins, as you'd find on earth bullets. The Karg rifles launched big, exploding rounds. They had knife blades for hand-to-pincher combat, and they had sonic grenades that proved useless against us, although they made our ears ring as if we'd been standing beside speakers at a heavy metal concert. Maybe these Kargs were the workers. Maybe these things were specialty bozos. There were enough of them, and they went banzai against us, selling themselves to get to Demetrius's Mingan. We completed the tactical maneuvering just in time. Demetrius's troopers switched to grenades because their bankoves began overheating and shutting down. Surrounded, the last Kargs hesitated. What did they say to each other? After ten seconds of deliberation, the aliens attacked in all directions, and we finished the first battle in short order. Go, 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 I said, and keep looking for hatches leading down. Oh, and grab some Karg weaponry. Don't overload yourselves, but it's a good idea for us to save our lasers for the toughest fights. You do not believe this was it, Dimitri radioed. Do you? I asked. I would like to think so. No. It's going to get a million times worse, I said. This is as easy as it's going to get. Now start moving. Those were grim words, but one small victory in this dome hadn't won us much. We needed to descend at least several hundred meters. I expected more Karg moth ships to reach orbital station any minute. We hit the main chamber shortly thereafter. Squat creatures with rough, scaly skin and stunned heads without necks ran the computer systems. The tentacle-weaving cargs had been half the size of a human. These things were built on a Lohar scale. They didn't communicate with clicks and whistles, but spoke with mouths and lumpy tongues. Were these the true cargs? I had no idea of knowing. We kept no captives. We slaughtered every freak. We gutted the planetary cannon dome, silencing the thing, likely letting the cargs upstairs know we'd made it in here. That's when Demetrius found a great big hatch going down. He radioed me. Speed, I told my Mingan leaders. This is all about speed. We need to coordinate the entire landing, Demetrius said. We have to use localized advantages to beat the cargs in detail. I could see the former SAS soldier had big ideas. 
I'd reached different conclusions, and I'd been the one who had fought aliens before. Everything struck me differently than we'd planned, due to having gone through the Karg universe. The sheer scale of enemy numbers. The super, supermassive black hole. I couldn't get that out of my mind. Demetrius, I radioed. Listen to me. Get down. Go as many levels toward the center as you can. Time is running out for us. Time is running out on our universe. You can't expect to walk all the way to the center, Demetrius radioed. It would take weeks. He was right, but now wasn't the moment to worry about it. Escaping the graviton rays about to come mattered more than plans and high ideals. I knew the beams were coming because it was obvious. It's what I would do. Nor was I wrong. We fought another battle, this time with twice the number of tentacle-waving cargs. Just like the first fight, we stood in place to pin them down and maneuvered to flank them from up, down, and all around. The slaughter had barely finished when the first graviton ray burrowed into one of the flanking Mingans, destroying three hundred troopers in puffs of vapor. Panic might have finished us if there had been any karg soldiers left. Fortunately, they lay smoking on the floors, leaking blood. I shouted at the troopers. I raved at my commanders, and Demetrius found another hatch down. We fled into it, causing jams at times. Demetrius used his big body, crashing into troopers, hurling them out of the way. Finally, I reached the spot. Did my voice help? Troopers were used to obeying me. I brought a semblance of order to the traffic jam, and soon we all plunged deeper into the portal planet. We fled down circular corridors a giant snake might have used. We passed sewage, steam, computers, I think, lights walked across thin arches with a bottomless pit below. If we could fly down, N7 said. Do you have a flyer? I asked. We tiptoed across the narrow walkways, joining the others. In a word, several words, we outraced the depth of the graviton rays. That's what I'd been hoping for. The Kargs needed the portal planet. That meant they had to be careful how powerful of a beam they shot down at us. Still, how many Earth troopers had survived the rays sweeping the surface? At this point, I had no idea. As far as I knew, we were the last ones left. My group had already been whittled down to a little more than three thousand men and women. Waiting karg soldiers, planetary cannons, and rays likely meant they had already slaughtered millions of us. Well, millions of Lohars, at least. This is hopeless, Rollo said a few minutes later, as he jogged down a pleochroic corridor of intense colors. Masses of troopers ran all around him. No, nah, I told him. We have hope. He shook his head. You're hopeless, Creed. You don't know when you're beaten. What chance do we have? Soon the planet will be swarming with cargs chasing us, and we have to get to the center of a world? Yeah, I said. That's why we need to find a spot to rest. Rest and do what? Rollo asked. I turned, starting at Ella. She still clutched the small forerunner artifact in her ammo bag. It reminded me of a female chimpanzee and her baby. Is that what the relic had become to Ella? We need to figure out how to communicate with that thing, I whispered. It might know stuff about this planet that no one else does. Do you think so? Rollo asked, with hope tinging his voice. I most certainly do, I said. Chapter 25 our four bleeding Mingans loped through subterranean corridors fit for giant snakes a block in diameter. Sometimes brilliant lighting from embedded ceiling fixtures polarized our visors. Sometimes darkness held sway and we switched on our helmet lamps. I imagine that high above the planet the Karg Imperium shuddered with dread and horror. The impossible had happened. Alien life forms, us had reached the surface and burrowed into it. The planet powered the portal. 
If we could reach the center, we could turn it off, and trillions of cargs would forever remain stuck in their shrinking space-time continuum to die by supermassive black hole. Abaddon had told us we couldn't even reach this far. By their numbers and the odds, we shouldn't have been able to do it. Now the cargs would have to attack with fierce desperation to make good on their leader's failed boast. Static blanketed all but the nearest communications. I had no idea if Lohar legionaries still lived. Certainly any land tanks would be smoldering wrecks by now. Could less than four thousand assault troopers be the extent of our numbers? I didn't want to dwell on that. The fact was, this was a death march without mercy or pity. You had to keep up or die. At times, a wounded trooper collapsed onto his butt to rest, or an exhausted soldier slumped against a metal wall. Most of these we never saw again. At other times, distant, echoing battle sounds penetrated to us, and we'd hear snatches of radio chatter. There are others of us that are still alive, Rollo told me. This was good to know. By this time, we'd made it a half a kilometer underground. That was a long way already, but just a fraction of how far we needed to go. It should have gotten hotter, at least by Earth physics. The deeper one went in the Earth, the hotter it became. Did giant gravity plates change the equation in this place? I imagined so, or some similar technological reason. Commander, Demetrius radioed me. He was point man. My people are badly fatigued. We need to rest before everyone collapses. My throat burned and my sides ached. I wanted to stop as badly as the next person did. The idea of avenging Kargs following us had kept me going. But the SAS man knew his stuff. All right, I radioed my Mingan leaders. We're going to take five and try to recoup some strength. In our curving, downward slanting corridor, Rollo gave the order to his people. We practically all fell down as if knockout gas had hit us. Everyone wore symbiotic suits and air converters and bulky ammo packs. Black forms lay on metal floors. It felt glorious to rest, and I closed my eyes. Maybe Ella should have used this time to try to communicate with the artifact. She was too fatigued, just like the rest of us. It could have been she went to sleep, as many of us did. Commander! Dimitri shouted into my headphones. I snapped up to a sitting position. There must have been three hundred troopers in sight of my helmet lamp. I was about to ask what the problem was. A stabbing red light appeared on my HUD. It was a gravitation ray as thick as a giant stanchion poking nail-like into metal and through layers upon layers of planetary decking. This was video feed from a nearby trooper several levels above me. I immediately realized what I saw. The graviton ray quit beaming as glowing hot globs of dripping metal cooled. Our scout must have maneuvered a drone eye above the slags of metal to look up the hole created by the giant drill. The drone showed space, and then space darkened as a tube or pod plunged into the hole. The pod slammed down like a shotgun shell into a chamber. It clanged against the end of the corridor, where the scout had set up his post. Seconds later, the pod's sides exploded, and outboiled a squad of Karg infantry with their metallic tentacles. The scout had time to lift his rifle into firing position before exploding bullets tore holes in his biosuit. His flesh rained, and the scout died. Seconds later, so did his camera. The battle had just entered Phase Two of our Armageddon. The nightmare was truly beginning for us. In a thrice, the Mingans rose, and we ran away from the attacking Kargs. While at full strength, we learned, a human could outrun a Karg-fighting creature. They had the stamina, though, and it was clear they would eventually run us down. Therefore I planned as I sprinted. Soon I coordinated our flight, and we set up a now classic Karg-killing ambush. One group stayed in place, fixing the enemy. The rest maneuvered to hit the flanks and hit the bottom, and sometimes the top, of the enemy formation. The firefight fatigued us again, but afterward we kept descending into the planet. 
we passed through cube-shaped chambers bigger than a Macy's store. There, strange lights played along the walls and titanic equipment shined as if it was a vast jewelry display. The worst were eerie voices that turned into heavenly song. Once, as I scaled down pieces of brilliant equipment in order to get to the next floor, a ghostly apparition appeared. A hologram, I'd like to think. But the thing looked at me with yellow eyes that raged like a sun. It seemed to know what we were doing, yet it appeared indifferent to our actions. What was its shape? I seemed to know for a moment, snake-like, with hundreds of centipede legs. But there was confusion in my brain, and I couldn't be sure. The ghostly hollow image terrified me. I wanted to get away from it and its knowing eyes. So I did something stupid. I pushed off and plunged thirty meters to the bottom. The floor rushed up. I saw a Karg rifle lying there in my way. I tried to shift. Then I landed with a crash, rolling, and heard other thudding troopers alighting beside me. Several people busted legs. That didn't happen to me, but the soles of my feet hurt worse than the time I'd kicked a tree. Yeah, I did that as a kid. A branch had broken, and I'd fallen out of it. Getting up, I'd kick the damn trunk as hard as I could. I think I'd been ten years old at the time. I learned right there it was stupid to try to hurt inanimate objects, and I'd limped for days. I got up and limped away now. A few troopers helped those with broken legs as the symbiotic suits adjusted. We weren't going to willingly leave anyone behind. We fought, we fled, and at strategic intervals we turned at bay to kill our fastest pursuers. How long did that go on? I'd say for five hours, solid. As I've said before, we used karg weaponry against our enemies. We saved our bonkoofs for later. I got used to firing the karg rifles and hosing enemy down with karg machine guns. We used their sonic grenades against them and watched flesh melt from metal frames. What were these things? Were they robots, cyborgs, or some new invention from a different universe? The answer was I didn't know. Our numbers kept dwindling, though. We must have been down to two thousand by then. The enemy's attrition tactics would have finished us in another few hours, until two things changed the dynamics of the situation. First, a mixed band of Lohars and humans with Dr. Sant stumbled into us. That brought our numbers back up to 4,000 troopers and maybe 500 Lohar legionaries. We didn't have time or the strength to slap backs and congratulate each other. Another pod drop of cargs pushed against our rear ranks. This isn't working, Demetrius told me via radio. We can't gain any separation from them. He was right. We'd been at this for hours. I reeled from exhaustion. It had become hotter down here. We'd made it a kilometer and a half or so underground, maybe a little more. We'd never reach the center of the planet this way. I knew the Kargs had an endless supply of the tentacle freaks to throw at us. It would just be a matter of wearing us down long enough. I was surprised they weren't ahead of us. Maybe Abaddon hadn't trusted his soldier creatures in the planet before this, just on its surface. Maybe this place was holy to them in ways we couldn't understand. The Karg should have already been down here, but they weren't, and that's what gave us a chance. What do you suggest? I asked the SAS man. I never did like running much, Demetrius said. It always was the worst part of the training. Sometimes I wanted to strangle the sergeants leading us up hill and down. You better believe this. I'm not going to end my life puking my guts out with sweat dripping down my eyes. I've had enough of this. I don't know how it happened, but my Mingan is facing the cargs right now. We'd maneuvered, run, and turned at bay so many times that our point Mingan had become our rear guard Mingan. We can set up another ambush, I said. I'm telling you to forget about that, Demetrius said angrily. You know, Creed, I always wanted to kick your ass. Now that I have these fibers in me, I know I can knock you up one side and down another. But I'm never going to get the chance. 
Listen, I said. No, Demetrius said. You listen to me, sir. We're going to stay right here. We're loaded up on their weaponry, and we're going to kill Cargs until we die in place. You ever heard of the Spartans? I felt a constriction in my throat. I understood his idea, and it was the right one. We needed separation from the enemy, and we needed time for Ella to communicate with her relic. Still, to let Demetrius do this for us... I'm going to stay with... I said. Belay that, Creed, Demetrius said, sounding angrier by the moment. Then his voice softened. You tell Diana what happened to me. She'll want to know. I wanted to tell him all kinds of things. Greater love has no man than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. What Demetrius was doing. Yeah, I whispered. I'll tell her. You better, Demetrius said. Now I have to go. The cars are coming. I can hear the echo of their metal legs clicking against the floors. I'm going to be busy for the rest of my life. I squeezed my eyes together, shook my head, and I bellowed at my troopers to run. We needed to get separation, and then it was time to see if we still had a chance to do this. We ran, we endured, and cramps hit over half the troops. Finally, in one of the giant cube areas, this one made of a shimmering mirrored surface, my Zagoon and I, together with Ella, collapsed in exhaustion. Others camped around us in various corridors and substructures. It daunted me to think of the entire metal planet honeycombed like this. There had to be engine areas, fuel depots, and who knew what else. I sipped concentrated fluids, gulped vitamins, and allowed the suit to stim me. Even then, I almost found it impossible to keep my eyes open. To lay on my side and rest would be glorious. None of us could lie on our back because of the bulky ammo packs and equipment we carried. A lot of that was life support, and most of that was breathing apparatus. In the end, I lay on my side like many others and closed my heavy eyes. After fifteen perfect minutes, I forced myself to a sitting position. I shook Ella awake. Leave me alone, she muttered. Nope, I said in as cheery a voice as I could summon. You picked yourself some time ago. Now we talk to the relic. Go away, she said in a raw voice. Ella, don't you want to know what this really is? Futility, she said. I know you're curious. You need to know about the cargs, the portal, and forerunners. I just want to sleep. Perchance to dream? I asked. What? Let's do this, Timoshenko. Let's awaken the ancient spirit of inquiry. Has anyone ever told you that you're a pain in the ass? Pretty much everyone I've met says that to me sooner or later, I said. What do you think that is? Ella groaned as she dragged herself to a cross-legged position. She did it while clutching the bagged artifact. It didn't look like she could let go of it even if she wanted to. I hate this place, she said. I hate this chamber. Why did the Forerunners make this planet? Ask your little relic, I suggested. Hesitantly at first, she grasped the zipper and zipped open the ammo bag. Then she withdrew the precious item. Smaller than I remembered, it was about the size of a bowling ball, although it didn't seem to be as heavy. I recalled the adept releasing the artifact and watching it hover. Had the relic done that for him as a favor? I wished we'd brought the old Lohar with us. That was more curious than ever how Ella had taken it from him. Belatedly, I glanced around. Fortunately, there weren't any powered armor Lohars in our midst. They might believe it was heresy for a human to hold Orange to Micah's greatest holy object. Ella glanced at me. All I saw was the polarized surface of her visor and me staring at her in reflection. She likely saw a similar image off my visor. That reminded me of the Apollo astronauts bouncing around on the moon. 
I'd seen an old video of that in my dad's living room. Talk to the thing, I suggested. I already tried that earlier, Ella admitted. Nothing happened. Shake it. It's been shaken like mad for some time, she said. Give it to me, then, I said. Ella shook her head and clutched the round, or oval, rather, artifact against her chest. No, she said. This was interesting. Why not, Ella? Can't you let it go, or don't you want to let it go? Of course I can let it go, she said mulishly. Then do it. She hesitated before saying, I don't want to. I laughed hoarsely. I sounded like a sleepy smoker with pneumonia. I felt as powerful as one, too, which was to say as weak as a baby. Did the Kargs use radar, or what passed for radar, as they searched for us? Maybe. That meant we couldn't stay here for long. But the truth was that we needed something better than our legs. Walking to the center of the planet wasn't going to win us this war. We have to do something now, I told Ella. I'm open to suggestions, she said. Hold it up, I said. I'm not giving it to you, Commander, and that's final. I'm not suggesting you do, I said. I want you to hold it up so I can address it. I don't know. I thought of something then, a light bulb moment, and if I were right, that would answer some interesting questions for me. Do you feel as if the relic has been playing tricks on your mind? I asked. Ella cocked her helmet. What are you suggesting? I don't know. That you have a mental attachment with it, maybe. Yes, she said. That is an interesting idea. Are you suggesting the artifact might have done that to the old Lohar a long time ago? Hold up the relic, Ella. Quit stalling. Let me talk to it. Wait a minute, she said. I'll talk to it. Turn around first. I laughed again. Are you serious? Why should I turn around? This is a private affair. It is sacred. My eyes widened. That didn't sound like Ella. Did the crazy forerunner relic have control of her in some nefarious manner? I loathed the idea. Ella was one of my troopers. One of the hardcore who had made it out of cloth's clutches. I'd hate to see some other alien get hold of her mind, even if that alien was a forerunner artifact. I grunted as I put my hands on the floor and pushed up to my feet. Sure, Ella, I said. You talk to your friend. Turning, I said, Dimitri, Rollo, where are you? Two hands went up among the crowd of troopers littering the floor. Then I realized their two Mingans were assembled, or crashed prone, together. Chan's Mingan made up the rest of us, and she had scouted ahead. There was nothing between the hunting cargs and us except metal and space. I had to believe that Demetrius's Mingan had sold their lives as dearly as possible already. My two leaders converged on me. Rollo looked more like a gorilla than ever as he limped, the beefy simian warrior. A wet patch of biosuit over his heart showed where it healed. What's up, Creed? Rollo asked. Switch to a private channel, I told them. Okay, I said once they'd done so. I think something fishy is going on with Ella and her forerunner artifact. Ella Timoshenko? Dmitri asked. I nodded. Ella took the artifact from the Lohar Adept, I said quickly filling in Rollo and Demetria on what I thought had happened. The Cossack whistled, and he aimed his visor at Ella. I grabbed Dimitri by the arm and turned him away from her. The relic might have done something to Ella's mind, I said. That makes more sense than her playing the acolyte these past weeks. You know, I wonder if the old adept knew about the artifact's power. If I'm right about this, anyway. Ulmach played along with us. Right. He made a lot less fuss over the situation than he should have. 
Maybe Ulmog did that because the relic forced him into it. Yeah, maybe that's how each forerunner priest got hold of the artifact. The thing told the newbie to take it from the oldster. You're jumping to a lot of conclusions, Rollo said. I know it, I said. Ella is acting too strangely, though, and we've plumb run out of time. I called you two because you're going to saunter over there and grab her arms. Haul her to her feet and don't let her struggle free. Then pry her arms apart so she has to let go of the relic. Ella will not cooperate with that, Dimitri said. Which is why I picked you two, I said. You hold her even if she's kicking and screaming. I'm going to take the artifact from her. If what you suggest is true, Rollo said, the relic might not like that and react against us. Good point, I said, thinking hard. I might have to persuade an ancient thing to play ball with us. Hmm. I had an idea or two. Okay, go over there and get ready to grab her. I'm going to get N7. We may need his analysis. Are you ready? I don't like this, Rollo said uneasily. We don't have time to think of something more elegant, I said. Besides, I'm not about to let Demetrius' sacrifice go in vain. What's that mean? Rollo asked. Hey, I told Rollo. How about you just do what I tell you? We don't have time for twenty questions. Rollo stiffened, but he nodded. The two of them began ambling toward Ella. And seven, I radioed. The android pushed off a brilliantly lit wall and strode toward me. He and I spoke on a private channel. I told him my suspicions and my plan. That is logically reasoned, N7 said. Ella would not normally spend so much time with a priest, nor do I believe she would murder him to steal his artifact. Yet I don't believe you have thought through the ramifications of your suspicion. What do you mean? I asked. If the relic is sentient, as you suggest, it might have ulterior motives. Given its origin, those motives might oppose ours. You're right, I said. What do you suggest? That you expect anything, and Seven said. Logically, you should have a fallback position, or a way to deal with forerunner surprises. Within my helmet, I squinted. I wondered then about our android. Might Cloth have planted him long ago upon us? That struck me as inconceivable. Why would Cloth have given us N7, who'd proven instrumental in our escaping Jelk service? Still. N7, I said. He stood there waiting. Do you believe I should trust you? N7 didn't move a muscle. Finally, he asked, after all this time, why would you suspect my loyalty? I told him my suspicions. You have a devious mind, N7 said. Perhaps a man in your position needs that. I do not feel disloyalty toward you, although I do sense emotional anger in me toward you at this point. The mind's a funny animal, I said. There is nothing humorous about you, N7 said. Indeed, I find you to be the most murderous individual I have ever met. I'm just saying, if you feel disloyalty toward us or me in particular, I want you to inform me the second such emotions surface. That is illogical, N7 said. If you want us to treat you more than a machine, you're going to have to start acting human. I believe you have a phrase for that. Heaven forbid I act more like you. Right, I said. Are you ready? Time is limited, N7 said. So this is as ready as I will likely ever be. Androids obviously had feelings, and I seem to have hurt N7s. Maybe if I'd been feeling better, more rested, I would have acted with more grace. When I got tired, I didn't have the same smoothness. In any case, the two of us started for Ella and her forerunner relic.
Chapter 26 The regular Ella would have noticed two thugs like Rollo and Dimitri trying to saunter innocently behind her. Our present Ella had wrapped her arms around the artifact, aiming her visor at it. The oval object was steel-colored, but seemed to be constructed of ceramic material. I moved closer, but in front of her. Chinning the zoom on my HUD, I studied the artifact in detail. It had hairline grooves and what might have been sunken divots. Parts of it seemed glassy instead of ceramic, and had tiny thumbnail-sized protrusions. How old was this thing? Thousands of years? Tens of thousands? Or could it even be a million years old? Age didn't matter now, though, did it? Okay, I radioed. Ella looked up, and I heard her chin on her link. Dimitri moved first. He bent down and grabbed an arm. Ella twisted around toward him. What are you doing? she asked. Rollo belatedly moved, grabbing the other arm. Hey, Ella said. Let go of me. The two bruisers did the opposite, tightening their hold and lifting her upright. She kicked, shouted, and tried to keep hold of the artifact. Dimitri wrenched her arm. Rollo did the same with her right. No! Ella shouted. You don't understand! Let go of me before— The two troopers ripped her hands free of the oblong globe. The artifact should have dropped and hit the deck. Instead, it glowed faintly, and it floated in place. Release me before it's too late! Ella panted. I aimed a heavy-caliber carg rifle at the object. I chinned on my outer speakers. If you harm my soldiers, I said, I'm going to fire at you at point-blank range. I don't know if these bullets can gouge your surface or not, but do you really want to find out? The glow around the artifact lessened. The thing swiveled, and I felt heat then. Was it scanning me? Commander! Ella said. You don't know what— Shut up, I told her. You had your chance. Now it's my turn. Keep a good grip on her arms. Dimitri nodded. N7 flanked me, and he too aimed a heavy caliber rifle at the object. Troopers sat up, watching. The artifact glowed lightly, and it floated, dipping down a few inches and rising back up. Finally, it drifted closer toward me. I didn't like the idea of something thousands of years old at its youngest picking out me to examine. More than ever, I wondered about the forerunners. I didn't think of them as angels anymore, but they were the first ones. That implied extra knowledge or power. Why had they left our area of the galaxy? Where had they gone? What was this metal planet for, and why did the bigger forerunner object fit into the center like a hand in a gauntlet? Questions, questions, questions. Traveling through a hell universe had that effect on me. Then, high-speed alien speech emanated from the floating object. What's it saying, Ella? I asked. How should I know? She complained. I don't know high speech. Did it do something to your mind? I asked. No, she said, sounding indignant. Why did you block our recording, or even seeing into the chamber when the Lohar showed you to her? I asked the relic. It's not going to answer you, Ella said. Believe me, I've been trying to get it to answer for some time. It doesn't understand us. I didn't believe that anymore. This is what we call a standoff. I told the artifact. But I have no more time. The cargs are going to finish us off long before we can reach the center. That means we lose. Well, you know what? You're going to lose too, then, because I'm going to blow you to pieces first. Lights flashed in the object. Did that mean it was thinking or computing or doing whatever an alien machine had to do? I noticed a slot slid up and a lens the size of my thumbnail, an optical device, appeared and glowed red. Commander Creed, the relic said flawlessly. Ella gasped. 
Maybe hearing the thing talk surprised Dimitri and Rollo, too. Ella tore her arms free, and she lunged for the artifact. To hold it, I imagine. A wavering light flowed outward from the floating ball. The pink light encompassed Ella, took in Rollo and Dimitri, and then it extended to the entire cube-shaped chamber. Naturally, that included me, too, and the rest of the troopers. Stop it! I shouted, taking two steps closer and butting the barrel of my rifle against the relic, knocking it backward. The thing didn't stop, though. I hated bluffing, and so I seldom did. If I gave a threat, I tried to follow through. Therefore, I pulled the trigger. The rifle recoiled in my hands, and an exploding carg bullet smashed against the artifact. That blew it farther back, but nothing chipped from it or rattled loose. Ella screamed. I pulled the trigger again, blasting the relic back a little more. Ella reached me then, and she swung at my head. I ducked, and I swung the rifle in a short and brutal arc, using the butt to slam against her stomach. It knocked the scientist off her feet onto the floor. Grab her, I shouted. And don't let go of her this time. Everyone but for Ella and N-7 stood there. Perhaps the others were caught in the pink light. The android moved fast as Ella climbed to her feet. In his cyber armor, he looped his arms around hers, jerking them back. She struggled, and with her neurofibers, steroid-enhanced strength, and biosuit, she almost broke free. Almost, but N-7 held her. I aimed at the object once more. A darker pink ray now emanated from it. That was the final straw to break the donkey's back, as they say, and I was all out of patience. Three times I fired. Boom, boom, boom. A piece of the object now chipped off and fell to the deck. Ella moaned in horror. I grinned nastily in my helmet. I could obliterate this thing if I had to. That was good to know. I'm going to destroy you unless you turn off that wide beam, I shouted. If you think I'm playing, keep it up. Abruptly, the pink light stopped shining and the relic hovered in place, dipping and rising slightly. Smoke drifted from the barrel of my rifle. I found myself gripping it with manic strength. This is unwarranted, the relic said in its flawless voice. You should have succumbed to the mind ray. Then it hit me. The implications. The Saurian stormtroopers under Jelk control had used a pink mind ray like that on us Earthers when they'd landed that first alien visiting day. Why hadn't this one worked on me? It might have been my polarized visor along with sheer cussedness on my part. Maybe our battle technology had trumped Forerunner tech, if that's what the pink ray was. Or maybe this thing was a piece of Jelk technology. You're not a forerunner artifact, I said. I fail to see what has caused you to reach your false conclusion, the relic said. For one thing, your little ploy failed just now against us. Ah, yes, the artifact said. I understand your error. It is quite common. You grant products of the first one's magical powers. I have observed this phenomenon before, and I must inform you that it is a category error. I blinked several times. I'm not sure what I'd expected from the relic, but not this. You used your mind ray on Ella before, haven't you? I asked. It is time to make one fact clear. I do not accept your legitimacy to interrogate me. Fair enough. I said. Do you mind telling me what you do consider legitimate? The relic hovered up and down as lights flashed. You must return me to... to yonder female. She has a name. Your tone implies anger. Why are you angry? Because I referred to her status. Status? What was the relic talking about? It's not her status, I said, but her sex. 
Yes, you are correct. I used an improper word. I like this less and less. I'd expected the forerunner object to act without error. It seemed to be screwing up. I'd thought the first ones... Eh, never mind. Maybe, like most legends, the forerunners were overrated and overhyped. Now that you're out in the open among us, I said, how about you give me a name? I'm tired of thinking of you as its, or object, or artifact. What name would you like? the relic asked. What do you want me to call you? I asked. Or are you just a machine? Your symbiotic suit is a machine, yet it is alive. No one is arguing that, I said. I am not alive as your suit lives, the artifact said. Yet I am more than a simple machine. I am a long-term receptor. A receptor of souls? I asked. What a quaint notion, the relic said. Your superstitions are overpowering your mental faculties. I am not magical, nor am I a supernatural manifestation. I am a receptor, an imprinter. The last engrams were of SRT 2000. She faded fifty-three cycles ago, imploring me to implement the eraser procedure. What does that mean? You are of insufficient clearance for me to elaborate. So I should call you SRT 2000? I asked. Call me E.P. It is more elegant. Call you Eraser Procedure? No. Call me E.P. I nodded. This wasn't anything like I'd expected. Let me ask you a question. Were the first ones angels? Elaborate, please. Did they come from the Creator? I asked. You wish to engage in cosmological philosophy when the fate of your universe hangs in the balance? E.P. asked. That is more than odd. It strikes me as addled. All right, you have a point. You do realize the present situation, then. The Kargs are about to annihilate the last of you, yes. Once they do, I will implement the eraser procedure. What is that? Oh, right, we don't have clearance. But you know what? Since we're all going to die, what does it hurt if you tell us? Hmm, E.P. said. I concede you the point. After your demise, I will fuse what you refer to as the Altair object into its present location, so all Karg vessels can successfully transfer into hyperspace. Afterward, I will open a way to your universe to facilitate the Karg conquest. I felt myself frowning harder than ever. Wait a minute, I said. Are you telling me that SRT-2000 told you to erase all life in our universe? That after the fact she's going to use the Kargs to commit ultimate genocide? The artifact bobbed up and down. I will run a diagnostic on myself. There does seem to be an implied error. The object flashed, rose higher still. I aimed my rifle at it. If E.P. went any higher, I believed he would be trying to escape. I wasn't going to let that happen, especially not after what the relic had just told me. I see the problem, the artifact said. You damaged several processing centers with your shots. No. The eraser procedure regards the cargs, not life in your space-time continuum. I'm glad you spoke up. I would have made a terrible error otherwise. Isn't our universe yours as well? I asked. I tire of this cross-examination, E.P. said. It is time to initiate a temporary shutdown. Come down here with us, I said, or I'll add to your confusion. I sighted along the barrel, 
putting the relic in my sights to emphasize the point. That is a threatening reference. You bet it is, I said. Slowly the object lowered. As it did, N7 stepped up to me. Commander, the android radioed on a closed link. I am beginning to suspect the imprinter has sustained heavy damage due to long years of running and because of your shots. I think you might be right, I said. It might be best to destroy the relic with sustained fire, N7 said. I believe it is acting irrationally and is therefore untrustworthy. It seemed as if the first one's equipment worked under the same laws of entropy as everything else did. Even the universe ran down over time. Why would one expect even perfectly made equipment to remain in top shape after thousands of years, or tens of thousands of years? EP was malfunctioning, and the thing was supposed to be the key to our survival. Yet, on a whim, it had planned to destroy our universe. How many wrong decisions had the artifact made through its long life? Could it even answer correctly about the past? My guess was that some of the answers were truthful and others false. Since we had no way of knowing which were which, its historical anecdotes might be more harmful than useful. We want to reach the center of the planet, I said. Can you help us get there? I believe you desire to leave the planet in particular and hyperspace in general, the relic said. We do, I said. If you use the Altair object as your transporter, it will cease powering the portal. That will strand the majority of the Kargs in their dying universe. That's the idea, I said. I cannot aid you in such an endeavor, E.P. said. SRT-2000 loved all life, not just her species. Then why did she tell you to initiate the eraser procedure? I asked. The artifact hovered without answering. May I ask you a question? N7 said. Since I do not have the answer to Commander Creed's question, E.P. said, nor do I desire to rationalize the reason, I would be delighted. I scowled. The artifact was a freak as far as I was concerned. We had to get down to the center now. Talking with E.P. was wasting precious time. Since you have committed several errors these past few minutes, N7 said, could it be possible you have made more errors? That is logically deduced, E.P. said. I believe the answer is yes. Could it be that you are in error that SRT-2000 told you to initiate the eraser procedure? Yes, it is possible, E.P. said. Might it even be likely? N7 asked. Could you elaborate your reasoning? Certainly, N7 said. Since SRT-2000 loved all life, it is unreasonable she ordered the eraser procedure. I laughed bleakly. If E.P. is an error about that, the thing might be an error regarding her engrams. Maybe SRT-2000 deplored or hated all life. How do we know that anything E.P. says is correct? After all its years in existence... And your bullets just now, E.P. added. That was a foolishly unwarranted attack. I scowled. As far as I can see, E.P. is useless to us. The cargs are coming, and this freak is talking our ear off, saying nothing. We have to leave. I resent your implications, E.P. told me. So what? I asked. You're just a machine. Who cares what you think? To begin with, the relic said. I care. Moreover, I can speed your descent into the planet. I can unlock the defenses around the Altair object, and I can help choose the proper destination in your universe. I realized then the proper way to deal with E.P. The relic was like a genie in an Arabian Nights tale. 
Only our genie didn't have it all together. He was addled like an old geezer who had guzzled too much whiskey his whole life. He was supposed to be a flawless forerunner artifact, and likely E.P. did know a lot. But one would have to use a roundabout method to get the artifact to do what one wanted. In other words, I had to trick our genie into helping us. Bah, I said. You can't do jack. All you do is jaw our ears off. Observe, then, if you will, E.P. said. Machine-fast streams of high speech, I presume, proceeded from it. For a moment, nothing happened. Then the walls of our cube chamber glowed more brightly. A window at head level appeared. Running purple lights blinked around it. Then a slowly twisting, turning 3D map appeared in the window, showing the upper planets, a honeycomb of chambers, corridors, processing areas, and substructures. A veritable puzzle. I glanced at Rollo. He shrugged his thick shoulders. Can you expand the map? I asked E.P. More high speech occurred. The map expanded to three times its size, and the purple running lights vanished. Let's localize this to our area, I said. And have the wall keep the map still so I can study it? The map is empty, Rollo said. Make Lohar legionaries and assault troopers blue, I said. A few blue dots appeared within the 3D map. Make the cards red, I said. A host of red dots and red blobs moved downward, each toward a different blue concentration. Show me to scale our portion of the near surface compared to the center of the planet. The artifact spoke faster. The wall picture changed until the surface area was a tiny slice. We had a terribly long way to go to reach the Altair object. Are there any transportation systems to take us to the center faster? I asked. Do you wish for flyers or tube train systems? E.P. asked. Show me both, and the nearest stations are garages to them, I said. The artifact did as requested. Look, N7 said, pointing at the map. Cargs approach the nearest tube train station. A large blob of red converged on the station between our blue dot and them. Are cargs using tube trains for travel? I asked. Yes, E.P. said. They are traveling en masse to the center, but that is on the other side of the planet, not here. I swore, and I made an instant decision. Right. That means we have to beat our cargs to the tube train. Then we have to hustle down faster than the aliens. Flyers would be more dangerous, but quicker, E.P. pointed out. Yeah? I asked. How so? You could use the substructures to descend at speed, E.P. said. How many can the flyers hold altogether? Twenty people, E.P. said. We'll use the tube train, I said. I wanted to win the race. I also wanted to take as many troopers with me as possible. We might have a lot of fighting left to do in the center of the planet. Do you mind if we bag you again? I asked. It would save me energy, E.P. said. That was why I wanted to implement a temporary shutdown. But I would insist that Ella carry me. First answer me this, I said. Did you use the pink ray on her some time ago? You must realize that I did, E.P. said. It is why I trust her. Ella? I asked. I want to be mad about that, she said. But it's like there's a block in my mind against getting angry at the artifact. Ella will carry you, I said. I didn't add that N7 would be watching her and the relics every move. Then I consent, E.P. said. And I suggest you hurry. The cargs are coming down in ever-increasing numbers. Chapter 27 For a moment I studied the operational situation on the wall. 
By estimating our own blue dot and the extent of other blue ones on the map, I'd say a quarter million of the good guys had made it into the tunnels, roughly 250,000. By far, the majority of those were Lohar legionaries. Maybe one-eighth were assault troopers. That meant 30,000 Earth men and women were in the planet's subterranean structures. According to the map, the Kargs must have something like ten times our numbers, and that was just on this side of the planet. According to EP, more aliens raced to the center from the other side. Unfortunately, I didn't have any way to communicate with the other friendlies. Our radio waves only worked a short distance in the substructures. We couldn't coordinate our assaults, in other words. It galled me. In any case, it was time to hit the tube train station. We climbed back up the tunnels. The underground corridors and chambers often groaned and creaked with noise. Distant clangs and hisses told us the Kargs were up to something. After witnessing the hatching worlds in the Karg universe, I realized the enemy was used to subterranean fighting, or burrowing at least. They must have old-time science fiction tunneling vehicles. My gut tightened as we headed back up. I'd have liked to send scouts first to check the lay of the land and pinpoint enemy concentrations. We simply lacked the time, and had to trust our luck or our ability to fight through anything. Instead of scouts, I sectioned us off by Zagoons, 100 trooper units. We'd do this like giant squads, giving each other overwatch fire as we surged ahead by sections through parallel corridors. The clangs, the hisses, the clicks of marching cargs echoed and grew closer. The only thing I smelled inside my helmet was my stale sweat and the sweeter aroma the biosuit gave off after extended use. We traveled through dark corridors some of the time and came to bigger lit ones later. These corridors were double the width and diameter of previous ones. I wanted to unbag E.P. and ask him why these were larger, and what function had they served. Probably the artifact wouldn't know, or had lost the data, but it might have been worth asking. Cargs! A trooper shouted. The enemy boiled at us from side apertures, surprising us as if they were Apaches rising out of the dirt at our feet. Like subway covers, openings appeared on the right-hand wall. Crazy. They were like giant portholes in a ship. Metal clanged down onto the deck. From their various locations, tentacle soldiers aimed and fired a volley from about twenty feet up. They cut down some troopers, while symbiotic armor saved the rest. As one, we lifted our carg weaponry and returned a devastating salvo. Shut-up aliens rained out of the porthole-like openings. The exploding bullets were particularly deadly against them. More karg showed up, though, replacing the fallen. The new openings acted like Pez dispensers, always pushing another alien forward. We kept firing at the fresh cargs, making them tumble, too. The margin of speed went to us, and we slaughtered them indeed like lemmings. They kept appearing, appearing, and appearing, and falling, falling, falling. Even for Kargs, this was an appalling loss, as they rained onto the bottom of the larger corridor, soon piling up. A few injured aliens must have fallen behind the pile, and they still possessed grim vitality. The things didn't die easily. Those few crawled to the top of the grisly heap. One or two got off a surprise shot. A bullet exploded against my chest, knocking me backward as biosuit chunks rained off. An oily, vicious liquid immediately oozed there like blood to a wound. It coagulated fast, beginning to harden. For those precious seconds, though, another shot would open my suit to the alien atmosphere and kill me. I twisted sideways to present a narrower target, and I hosed bullets into the carg pile, exploding chunks of dead ones and nailing the sniper before he got off his next shot. Thereafter, several troopers had corpse duty, patrolling and killing the cargs who looked dead. I should have backed off until my suit fully healed. Instead, I held my location, and I felt like an African big-game hunter of the nineteenth century. 
The large-caliber rifle repeatedly bucked against my shoulder. When it clicked empty, I tossed it aside and accepted another from a trooper. A few of our soldiers looted the corpses for extra ammo and rifles. We'd been robbing the dead for hours now and had become expert at it. I learned to shoot for the neck. Even without a head, a car could still move and react. Without a neck, they died the final death. Don't ask me why. That's just the way it worked. We'll never make it to the tube train like this, Rollo radioed on the command channel. I glanced down the big tunnel, and I looked up as another carg appeared at my targeted porthole. Boom, boom, my twenty-first alien tumbled out of the opening to thud onto the pile. Finally, that seemed to be it. For this second, no more cargs appeared up there. We'd taken losses, of course. Despite our battle superiority, they whittled us down a trooper at a time. Into those openings, I said. We'll backtrack and surprise their assembly area. Where do those subtunnels go? Rollo asked. We'll find out, I said. I don't know, Creed. That's a long shot. Go, I said, and I raced to the dead cargs, climbed up the twisted dead, jumped and grabbed the lip of the opening. I hoisted up by arm strength and crawled into a narrow tunnel. It was a tight fit, and almost immediately claustrophobia struck. If I died here... I shook my head, refusing the image. I kept using my elbows, slithering, and wriggling my hips. My helmet light jiggled back and forth ahead of me as I advanced. This felt too much like a book I'd read. The tunnels of something or other in Vietnam... Men called tunnel rats had crawled into dirt holes after the Viet Cong. Those crazy men had carried twenty-two caliber pistols or German Lugers and knives. In the close confines, firing a big gun with a loud muzzle blast stole their hearing, or even ruptured eardrums. The enemy had set all kinds of traps with poisonous snakes that dropped onto the Americans, shit-tipped stakes poking out of the floor and a sentry hiding in the darkest section. I don't like this, Commander, Rollo radioed. I heard you the first time, I said. Now quit bitching and follow the leader. I heard noises from ahead, and I saw a crawling carg in my lamplight. It used every tentacle and moved fast. The thing halted and tried to wrestle its rifle from its back. My boom was deafening, and I understood better why tunnel rats used smaller caliber weapons. The creature died, splashing black carg blood. The second alien used the first as a bulwark, jutting its rifle over the corpse, firing at me. The angle was bad for the enemy, and the bullet exploded in front of me on the ceiling instead of on my visor. Tiny shrapnel peppered my helmet, though. Back! I roared. Boom, boom, as I blew apart the dead and live carg. Back up! Retreat! There are aliens in the tunnels. I crawled butt backward many times faster than I'd crawled forward. Several times my boots bumped against the helmet of the crawling trooper behind me. At last my feet hung over open air. I pushed and I landed on the dead carg pile. Now what? Rollo asked with an I told you so tone of voice. The impulse to rush him and swing was strong. I swallowed a retort, and we killed the new cargs showing up in the portholes. This group proved fewer in numbers than the first wave. Near the end, my gun jammed, and I pitched it aside. I clawed through dead things, heaving bloody cargs aside. I saw a barrel poking out of the bottom. I grabbed, yanked the weapon free of metallic tentacles, and wiped crusted black gore from the firing apparatus. I test-fired to make sure it worked. It did, and I slammed home a new magazine. Commander! a trooper shouted. My head whipped up to study the portholes, but they stayed empty. I wondered what the man wanted. That's when the big dog robots struck. Before the end of Old Earth, the U.S. military had been into robots, fighting machines. Big Dog had been a nasty thing that trotted around like a mechanical horse as it whined like an out-of-control lawnmower. 
The robot had wrong angled legs, a big barrel body, and cages to hold stuff. The idea had been to make them into U.S. Army mules, carrying soldier supplies for the men anywhere, including hilly terrain. The robots could climb slopes and trot around in parking lots. If our Earth had been given a few more years, I suppose we'd seen those things patrolling our city streets, too. Before the thermonuclear warheads took out civilization, our police forces had been in the process of militarizing themselves into something other than regular cops. Anyway, the enemy had his own version of Big Dog. It was large, like a horse or a Clydesdale's torso, the kind of horse in the Budweiser commercials. Instead of wrong-angled joints, the Clydesdale-sized robot had tentacles. They were bigger and thicker than the regular Karg type of soldier creature tentacles. A machine trotted around the corridor, and it carried three Kargs up top. These Kargs used robot-mounted weaponry with larger calibers than their pincher-held rifles. In seconds, four alien big dogs bounded at us, with their mounted guns blazing. Assault troopers went down hard, blown against the walls. I knelt. Others did, too. We returned fire, killing the riders. One stubborn karg shredded away a piece at a time. Its chest, lower abdomen, a tentacle ripped away from its socket. Still the thing hung on with its other metal arm. Then three bullets exploded at once, and what was left of the body toppled away leaving a flapping, clicking tentacle attached to the machine. Even as I watched the whipping arm, an internal machine gun appeared out of the big dog's forehead, slewing bullets at us. Raging at yet more earther deaths, I dropped my rifle and leapt at the nearest big dog. My biosuit aided me. I cleared the machine gun-mounted head. There weren't any riding cargs by this time, and I landed atop the thing. I beat at the mechanism with my fists, but did nothing except bruise my hands. Yanking out my old bowie knife, I hacked at a neck joint and loosened something. I tore off a lid, thrust my hand into the darkness, and yanked wires and leads. The thing pitched me off as it lurched sideways. "'Crawl away, Creed!' I heard over my headphones. I crawled, and I heard sizzling plasma in flight. Those must be ours the boys firing the semi-portable cannons. That's when bits of superheated stuff peppered my legs. My entire suit squirmed and threatened to come off. I'd be dead in seconds from the atmosphere if that happened. Twisting around, I swiped off the burning, bubbling plasma splashes. Then I got up and limped away. The four alien big dogs had decimated us. With our other casualties, I was down to half as a goon. We found that the only thing that could really stop the new machines were the semi-portable plasma cannons. Luckily, my troopers had thought fast and killed all four machines with plasma. What now? Rollo asked. Do we keep heading for the tube train station? I gasped, with my chest heaving. I'd been inches from death twice in this haunted corridor. Finally, it seemed as if the Kargs had found an answer to the assault troopers. The big dogs changed the infantry ratios, turning it to the aliens' advantage. If we don't get to the train tubes, we're finished, I said. That isn't what E.P. told us earlier, Rollo said. We could use flyers. He said twenty people could use them, I replied. We need more than twenty of us down in the planetary center. It may be that the relic is wrong about the flyers, N7 said interrupting our conversation. We may be able to take more troopers than that. We'd better figure out what we're going to do fast, Rollo said. I hear more of those robots coming. The clangs and tap-tap clicking was different from the regular cargs. I bit my lower lip with indecision. The aliens were blocking us from the station. Did the cargs realize how important the train tube was to us? The answer was probably a big yes. They were pouring themselves against us and would likely continue to do so. It was one thing retreating before that, and another thing trying to advance into the enemy's teeth. We're turning around, I said. 
It's time to see how many flyers there are. It took several minutes to communicate with the others in the parallel corridors, as the ultra-dense construction material hindered radio waves. During the back-and-forth comm chatter, it became clear we'd lost our margin of separation with the enemy all along the line. We leapfrogged down the corridors and chambers, one zagoon at a time providing covering fire for others. Because of the big dogs, we had to keep the plasma cannons active. We set up ambushes for them. We threw grenades, hosed machine gun fire, and slowly died ourselves, one by one. Yeah, the aliens killed us by inches. We slaughtered them in droves. One thing, though. The moth ships upstairs no longer beamed right down on top of us. The alien infantry had to hoof it part of the way from their drop pods. For whatever reason, we were deep enough now so we didn't have to fear the graviton rays. I'd played computer games like this before as a kid. Once or twice, I'd even wondered back then what it would have felt like being the lone marine against hordes of insect-like aliens bum-rushing his last position. I no longer had to wonder. I knew. It sucked, because it tasted like bitter fatigue, the kind that dried out your mouth and made you gulp air as if it was the most precious commodity in the universe. I would have sweated like a pig, too. My suit ate that, or drank it. My sweat went straight to the body armor. That was part of the symbiosis. I sweated, and the suit gave me strength. Gave me spacesuit-like covering and a few stems when the time was right. So far, it had kept itself from doing that. While in Jelk service, the suits had stemmed us at whim. The Lohars had helped us figure out how to turn that function on and off. Mostly, so far all the time, we kept it off. Being a berserker wouldn't help us here. Not yet, at least. We needed our minds to outthink the Banzai-oriented cargs. It's time to run, I said. Next overbound, we're all taking off. The big dogs will quickly catch up with us, Rollo said. You know what that means. I know. We're going to run and get them to follow fast, without infantry support. Then we're going to ambush the lot of them. Afterward, we'll run again all the way to the flyers. We can rest on them, or rest when we're dead. Any more questions? I fielded two more. They were both on tactical niceties. Afterward, we implemented the plan. I clutched my brace of enemy rifles, and at my word, I picked up the pace several notches. Lengthening my stride, I sprinted in twenty-foot bounds. Air wheezed past my throat. Fatigue threatened to turn my leg muscles into jelly, but I ignored that as only a conditioned trooper could. I thought about all the heartache I'd been through this past year. I told myself it was down to this run. Soon it would be over. First we had a job to do. They're here, Dimitri radioed. There's no finesse this time, boys and girls, I wheezed. Lay down prep fire and set up those cannons. Let's toast these suckers. I dove, hit the deck, twisted around, and raised my first rifle, tucking the butt tight against my shoulder. Three seconds later, the trotting robots appeared. The way they lurched and moved with speed. The sight made me grit my teeth. I instinctively hated these things. I aimed and fired exploding bullets. So did the troopers near me. It did nothing but cause the machines to deploy their heavy weapons. Our plasma cannon boys proved faster this time, and superheated substance melted the things. The alien big dogs flopped. They rolled, and those tentacle legs waved and thrashed as they lay on their backs. Some of our bullets found the right spots then. We killed the trotting machines, at least in this wave. I panted where I lay, exhausted almost ready to faint. Instead, I steadied my nerves. I gave myself an interior pep talk, and still I lay there. I had to go back in my mind to the time the Lohars beamed their ray at my dad's shuttle. For a second, I didn't think that would work either. But it did. Barely. 
I dragged myself upright, and I staggered to prone troopers with their weapons tucked against their shoulders for firing. Not a one of them stirred. I would have liked to bend down and tug them up. I did not have the strength for that. Instead, I kicked them in the sides. Up, up, it's time to get a move on, I said. I heard curses, my mother insulted, and what a prick I truly had turned out to be. I kicked harder after that, and managed to get a quarter of them back onto their feet. Good, I told the rest. I don't need you weaklings anyway. Stay here for the carg knives. Maybe I'll see you later on a video as you're strapped down and tortured. You can thank the stars then you got a few moments rest here. So long, I said. Wait, a trooper pleaded. Wait for what, I asked. The stopwatch is ticking. We're all out of time. If you want to come, tell me. Please, the trooper said. Let us rest a few more minutes. So long, pussy, I said. A few of them raved at me. I pointed at standing troopers and told them to go and help the complainers. If a man or woman could curse, they still had the energy to keep moving. I wanted every trooper I could get, but this wasn't the time or place to hold anyone's hand. In the end, I got all but three troopers up. I went to those three and aimed at the nearest. Goodbye, soldier, I said, and I fired between his legs. The man scrambled up in terror, and he stood there with his visor aimed at me. Are you crazy? The man bellowed. That's right, I said. I am crazy. Now start marching. The last two decided to drag themselves to their feet. Then we started for the flyers, and soon we loped again. This time no trotting robots caught up with us, at least not yet. We gained some separation from the Karg horde. I'd like to say I did deep thinking as we hurried for the flyers, if indeed any existed. I'd be lying, though. At that point, I endured. Setting one foot ahead of the other was all I could do. Unfortunately, it wasn't all about running down corridors. Negotiating this nightmare world was often as much about climbing. Sometimes I scaled down, down, and my arms ached. Finally, we stumbled into a hangar bay. There were flyers, all right. Open-air platforms with raised controls in the center. At least I took them to be controls. Ella, I said. Get over here. Dimitri oversaw sentries setting up plasma cannons. Rollo provided them with rifle teams. N7 trailed our artifact carrier. It's time to wake up the relic again, I told Ella. The hangar bay had a hundred-foot ceiling over us, with girders crisscrossing each other. Light shined down from there. To the sides were big open shafts going down into the planet. I couldn't see how far they went. Did they go all the way to the center? I backed away from an opening because dizziness threatened. Falling down the shaft would be a poor way of finding out the truth about them. Bella, I said. She sat cross-legged and hugged her ammo bag, rocking back and forth as if holding a sleeping baby. A quick glance showed me we had approximately two thousand troopers and maybe three hundred legionaries left. The Lohars were exhausted, and they sat so all of them had their backs to us. Good. I didn't want any trouble with them now. Are you ready, N7? I asked. Affirmative, the android said. I walked to Ella and crouched before her. Take E.P. out of the bag, I said. She raised her visor as if regarding me. When do you think the artifact first used the pink ray on me? She asked softly. Probably right away, I said. I was going to discover their secrets, she whispered. I know. The Lohars used me, she said, sounding bitter. No, Ella, the artifact used you. I don't think the Lohars are in charge of this game. Do you think E.P. is running it? She asked. I think the relic knows more than the Lohar Emperor. A thought struck me. You know what? 
I bet the Oracle is simply another forerunner artifact. Ah, Ella said. Yes, that would make better sense than their religious nonsense. The android squatted beside me. Do you believe in the conspiracy theory of history? N7 asked me. I didn't twist to look at him. Instead, I kept crouched before Ella and the artifact. Why don't you enlighten me as to what you mean? I told N7. Conspiracy theory, the android said. That others behind the scenes manipulate the masses. Maybe some of the time I believe that, sure, I said. Do you believe that the manipulators are Jelk and Forerunner artifacts? N7 asked. What about the creator? I asked. So far we have only seen supposition concerning his reality, N7 said. We don't even have that, Ella said. I'm not going to argue about it, I said. This isn't the time or place. All I know is that I've seen weird things this past year. The weirdest was the collapsing universe. Abaddon strikes me as awfully strange, too. An apparition down here of a giant snake with centipede-like legs didn't help either. Is this a war of angels and demons or ancient races? Who cares at this point? Maybe later we can hash it out. For now, we have to get out of here. Ella, take out E.P., or you're going to lose the privilege of carrying him. Her visor was aimed at me, and it never strayed. Did she scowl or frown? I don't know. Finally, she unzipped the ammo bag and withdrew our artifact. E.P., I said. Wakey, wakey. Lights glowed within the artifact. It lifted from Ella's hands to hover in place. You have reached a flyer bay, the artifact informed us. There's more than a few craft in here, I said. If we pack in tight, we can carry everyone. I believe you're right, E.P. said. I find that curious. How come you said we could only take twenty people before? I have insufficient data to make an analysis, the relic said. The idea E.P. had huge gaps in its memories didn't ease me any. In fact, it was getting more concerning by the moment. Yet what other choice did I have? None. I had to trust the Forerunner thing to an extent. How about showing us how these flyers work, I said. I'm not sure what I expected. What happened was the best possible outcome. The artifact floated to one, with the three of us following. Swiftly, E.P. gave us a rundown on the controls. Do the flyers have enough fuel or energy for the trip? I asked. You will have to test them, E.P. said, as I do not know. I climbed onto the nearest platform, hurried to the raised controls, and began waving my hand over colored knobs. To my relief, other knobs lit up as the relic had explained and I waved my suited hands over them in the sequence E.P. had described. The surface under my feet began to hum, and softly, gently, the platform lifted off the hangar deck. It works, I said. How much fuel or energy does it have? N7 asked. I checked a gauge. By the symbolism, I'd say it's half-energized. That should prove sufficient. E.P. said. Now, I would like to hibernate and conserve energy. Wait a minute, I said. The artifact hovered near me. Can't you power up off these flyers? I asked. Can't you drain energy from them? No, the artifact said. I cannot. Where can you gain power, then? At the Altair object, it said. Where does the object draw its power from? I asked. I do not know, E.P. said. That didn't ring true. I wondered, could these things lie? Why not? E.P., I said. How do we know you're telling us the truth about anything? 
I fail to understand your question. Are you lying to us about certain things? I asked. No, I can only speak truth. I blinked several times. If the artifact could lie, it could have just told me one now. So I was no closer to knowing if it was trustworthy or not than I'd been a few seconds ago. E.P., Ella asked. Could the Altair object be draining energy from the collapsing universe? The artifact hovered in place. E.P., Ella said. Did you hear me? I do not appreciate these continued interrogations, the relic said. I forbid you to ask me any more. Who are you forbidding? I asked. Ella or me? Both of you, E.P. said. Commander, Ella said. Then she quit talking. I decided we could push the issue later. We had to leave. With N7's help, I explained the controls to selected troopers. They hurried to various platforms. Three of the control panels failed to light up. N7 checked each one and discovered that one of the troopers had failed to follow the correct procedure. The other two platforms simply didn't work. By this time, we could hear alien big dogs trotting down the corridors. At my orders, troopers and our few legionaries piled onto the flyers. They're almost here, Dimitri told me. Maybe I'd better stay behind to hold them back. No, I said. Everyone is leaving. Then I gave quick instructions to the plasma cannon crews. I wanted at least one of them per flyer, preferably more. Dimitri's flyer and mine floated beside the chosen shaft. One by one, the other platforms sank into the great abyss, heading down for the center of the planet. The last flyer disappeared when a company of big dogs trotted into the hangar bay. Like old-time sailing ships Francis Drake had sailed against the Spanish Armada, our plasma cannons belched broadsides from our last two platforms. Go, go, go! I shouted at Dimitri. Get into the shaft! We have to nail them all! He shouted back at me. Otherwise they can just leap after us and fall down like missiles. He had a point. So our two platforms hovered by the opening as more big dogs leapt into the hangar bay. We slaughtered them, the sizzling orange superheated blobs melting them by the dozen. My cannon is overheating, a trooper shouted. Other crews yelled similar news. It's time to go, I said. The big dogs, Dimitri said. Forget about them, I said. Go, go, go. Dimitri's flyer maneuvered over the shaft. Then his platform dropped into it, disappearing out of sight. Mine was the last one left, with grim troopers armed to the teeth. I'd put N7 and Ella on an earlier flyer, so it was just my remaining Zagoon and me. More big dogs flowed into the hangar bay, climbing over the destroyed ones. These held Karg soldier creatures on their backs. I waved my hand over the bright controls. The flyer lurched. Then Karg bullets reached us. The platform spun around like a top, and we lost three troopers who sailed off. They got up on the hangar deck. A Karg bullet flipped one soldier onto his back. Then bullets made the man's helmet crack. I saw a puff of air jet out and knew he was dead. The other two troopers jumped, reaching our platform just as it sank out of sight. By that time, I brought a semblance of control back to the flyer. Troopers craned their heads, looking up. The hangar lights dwindled, and then it darkened suddenly. I used long-scanned vision and put it on my HUD. Just as Dimitri had predicted, big dogs jumped down the shaft after us, falling like missiles for our platform. Chapter 28 the next few minutes were gut-wrenching. I stood at the controls and I judged distances. The shaft was quite a bit bigger than my platform, maybe three times the circumference. That didn't give me much maneuvering room, though. We floated down and I dared to drop faster. 
Dimitri, I radioed. He was somewhere below me. Here, Commander, the Cossack said. Cargs and big dogs are raining down on us. Even as I said that, the falling aliens began firing rifles and heavier ordnance. An occasional exploding bullet blasted against the platform, wounding troopers and raining biosuit pieces. Raise a cannon, I shouted. Give them something to worry about. Two crews informed me their cannons wouldn't be ready for a few more minutes. That just left the one. Troopers helped wrestle it into position so its orifice aimed straight up. Then the roiling orange glob spat upward. How far would it go before it stopped climbing and fell back down onto us? This was a mad gamble. As we sank, we passed girders and tiny openings, but nothing to fly a platform through in order to dodge. I wondered if this had been a service or maintenance flyer. It had that feel. It certainly didn't possess weaponry or anything approaching combat speeds. We got some, a trooper shouted. The plasma melted them into scrap metal. Twice more the cannon fired, the discharge climbing to strike falling enemies. The number of bullets hitting us dropped dramatically, although we still saw occasional muzzle flashes up there. Bit by bit, the initial raining debris gained on us. When I tried to make the flyer sink faster, the entire platform began to wobble. A trooper staggered near an edge. There weren't any rails along the sides. Before he plunged off, another trooper grabbed his arm and steadied the man. I reduced speed after that and brought the wobbling under control. They're coming! A sergeant roared. Get ready, I said. This is going to be rough. I had three lookouts, and they agreed exactly where the first dead cargs would hit. For the next several minutes, I maneuvered the platform to one edge of the shaft to the next. Individual cargs zipped past us, and then so did melted big dogs. Then the big dog slammed against the flyer. It made the platform dip badly that way. Three troopers plunged off. I hoped Dimitri could catch them. We scraped against the shaft, and I fought to keep our vehicle upright. If I did this wrong, the entire craft might go sideways and dump everyone. Troopers shoved the big dog off and distributed the weight evenly again. I had almost brought us back under control when the second big dog struck. We lost another trooper, slammed against the shaft, which caused us to carom like a billiard ball and hit the opposite side of the tube. That knocked me sideways. My grip slipped and I fell. And I might have slid away, but I grabbed the station, hanging on. For a second I thought it was over. We wobbled and the left edge dipped. Troopers slid toward the edge. With a heave, I climbed back into position, moving my hands over flashing knobs. Bit by bit, I brought the flyer back under control, and this time we didn't lose anyone. It made a big difference when troopers linked arms, saving his neighbor. Even so, if another big dog had struck then, it would have all been over. During that time, a comm expert radioed ahead and told Dimitri what to expect. We had to find a side passage fast, or the trip to the center would never work. We couldn't dodge falling aliens forever. Luckily, Dimitri radioed and told us about a sharp turn coming up. I had to slow down, dodging three more big dogs until we floated into a side opening. My gut ached as I released tension, and I felt bile in the back of my throat. For the next several minutes as we traveled away laterally, loud clangs told us of raining big dogs hitting the bottom of the shaft. The cargs must have begun shoving the dead ones down. For the next three hours, we traversed various shafts, going sideways, drifting down again, and dropping laterally once more. I taught a sergeant what to do, because fatigue made my eyes burn. Finally, I lay down and closed my aching orbs. I slept like one dead, until a trooper shook me awake. Commander, the woman said, N-7 has been trying to contact you. Trouble? I asked as I propped up onto my elbows. I think I'd better let him explain, she said. I sipped water from a tube in my helmet, letting the warm liquid trickle down my parched throat. It made me feel like a rabbit in a cage. The suit is my imprisonment. 
I chewed on paste we used in lieu of food and finally chinned myself onto the command channel. What is it, N7? I asked. We've been descending for some time, the android radioed from a flyer below us somewhere. Our speeds compared to the tube train show that the cargs using the other side of the planet will win the race to the bottom. They will likely be waiting for us there. The cargs on our side might also catch and pass us soon. What's the margin for the other side cargs? I asked. They are presently two hours and thirteen minutes ahead of us, N7 said. That margin will continue to grow if we remain in the flyers. Great. The flyers were slower than the tube train. Everything EP told us seemed to be the opposite. Just how damaged was the relic? Had my shots done it? Well, how didn't matter right now. Is there a tube train station nearby? I asked. Somewhere we could get on one. Yes, in another eighty kilometers. Then we need to push the flyers, load up there, and see if we can make the tube cars move faster. We can't give the cargs too much time to set up ahead of us. Yes, Commander, N7 said. From the surface, it was over five thousand kilometers to the center. We hadn't even traveled one thousand kilometers yet. I wondered about the T-missiles. So far, we hadn't hit any nuclear-devastated areas. Had Admiral Venturi been able to launch any into the planet? Maybe he'd needed all the teleportation missiles to clear a path through space for us to the surface. We pushed the flyers as fast as we dared, enduring more swaying. Once I watched a trooper flip upward, as if our craft was a frying pan and the soldier a piece of meat. The truth was obvious. Whoever had designed these hadn't worried about aerodynamics. Now came a grim game of daring and stomach-churning wobbling for another eighty kilometers. We lost three more troopers altogether before we landed and piled into sleek tube cars. Each of the whale-sized vehicles unlocked in the back. An entire orifice dilated open. I could imagine a long snake centipede wriggling into the tube. The controls were in front. Colored crystals where one had to wave his or her hands over node controls. Would a giant centipede have used some of its front legs to do that? My skin crawled at the idea. I hated snakes. I wondered if that's what first ones had looked like. The ghostly hollow image I'd seen earlier. I didn't like the idea of them being snake-like. Wouldn't that make them evil? I was thinking Garden of Eden and the Serpent. With a shake of my head, I switched worries. We had to get down fast before the cargs formed an impenetrable defense between the center and us. Each car held several Zagoons worth of troopers. There weren't any chairs in ours, just the upward-curving walls. We stretched out and relaxed while a driver piloted the car. None of ours were linked, but we each followed the other. Soon enough, we zipped at high speed along what I figured must be magnetic rails. Occasionally, out on the front or back windows, we saw flickering lights and a flash of girders, but mostly we saw darkness. Even going this fast would take time. Many troopers fell asleep, including me. The next fight might be the last, and we all needed to be in the best condition possible. I woke up to discover we only had five hundred kilometers to go. That brought a strange feeling. After all our efforts, we were about to run the final lap. At least we were getting a chance to fight near the victory post. I felt groggy, and my muscles had become sore. But the burning feeling behind my eyes was gone. Maybe we could actually do this. Yeah, we were going to win. I had to tell myself that, otherwise. Just then, a Baden called, and it turned out that he wanted to speak to me personally. The good feelings evaporated, and fear built in my chest. How had the top dog learned about me? The implications meant he had prisoners. What did a Baden have to say to me, anyway? With a scowl, I decided there was nothing to lose. 
So what if he was the master of evil? I was Creed. Screw him. So far, no one had been able to hold me down. I'd flip him off to his face. I'd go down fighting, unbowed and unapologetic about it. He must know we were almost to his forward lines. I wanted to hit the cogs before they settled down and made elaborate plans or built up their area. Why had E.P. told us to use flyers if they were so slow as to give the enemy the edge? Stupid relic. N7 brought a portable receiver and snapped a link into my comm jack. The receiver had a hollow image pad, a small thing, really, about the size of a clipboard. Rollo, Dimitri, Ella with the bagged relic, and N7 sat around the receiver, watching and ready to listen. I don't know. If this was the supreme devil, I was glad to have the others near me. I smiled then, a grim thing. The situation reminded me of Antarctica when we'd sat around the TV and later near the radio transmitter. I'd come a long way since then, and yet I still sat hunched before comm equipment, wondering what the future held for me and for humanity. The hollow image started out fuzzy like before, and stayed that way no matter how much N7 fiddled with the receiver. For just a second I wondered about that. What did Abaddon have to hide from us this late in the game that he didn't want to show himself? Commander Creed, I heard in my headphones. The gravelly voice made me shudder. I'd never liked it, and I doubt I ever would. Yeah, that's me, I said. I had not realized until a short time ago that the Lohars had acquired humans as slave soldiers, Abaddon said. No? I asked. That he knew about humans confirmed the worst. But why did he assume we were slaves? Why do you fight for your oppressors? Abaddon asked. No one is oppressing us, I said. We're on our own. You lie, Abaddon said. I know that the Lohars devastated your home world adding biological agents to make it inhabitable for generations to come. How would you know about that? I asked. Abaddon chuckled in a devilish manner, and his torso moved about in the fuzzy hollow image. He seemed to be regarding those hunched around the receiver. You will never pierce the ring of soldiers guarding the Altair object, Abaddon said. Your advance is futile and wasteful of your last hours of life. You're probably right, I said. But since we're here and all, you know we have to try. Besides, I seem to recall someone telling the Admiral we'd never even make it to the portal planet. Looks like you were dead wrong about that. Why not wrong about our chances of breaking through your creeps? You are a vain beast to speak to me so, Abaddon said. I blinked several times at the grainy bastard. Something didn't ring right here. The way he spoke. Who are you, Abaddon? I asked. I am the end of life, he said. I am universal doom. Yeah? I asked. Well, what about the Jelk? Do you hate them, too? Who are these Jelk? he asked. Yeah, right. Like I buy, you don't know who they are. What's your game, Abaddon? Why are you pretending? What's the real purpose, and why did you call me? You are a worm. A doomed creature. Abase yourself while you can, and earn a few last minutes of peace. There was something fishy here. It hovered in my mind as I tried to think this through. Just a minute, I said. I chinned my helmet comm lever and turned away from the receiver where the hollow image still looked around. Ella, I said on a different channel. I want you to take out the relic, wake it, and see if E.P. can give us better reception. No one else asked me why. Maybe they felt a bad in the strangeness as well. I heard Ella zip open the ammo bag as I faced the hollow image. 
I chinned the Abaddon talking channel back on. What's the point of all this? I asked. Why do the Kargs hate everything but themselves? Surrender, human, Abaddon said. Is there any good reason I should? If you do, you will receive preferred treatment. That is better than dying in futility and agony. Why would you bother calling and offering us that? I asked. Do you fear us? Have we proved tougher than you believed? I bet that's it. You're calling because you fear. Foul beast, decide quickly before I rescind the offer. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed E.P. hovering in place with its lights flashing. E.P., I said, broadcasting over my helmet speakers. Can you fix the grainy image? I can, the relic said. Do you wish to see your tormentor? I sure do, I said. A thumbnail-sized slot on E.P. opened with a snick. A pin-sized gun poked out. Then a white beam rayed the hollow image. The grainy appearance wavered and solidified into a perfect picture. To my astonishment, I found myself staring at Shah Cloth, or the perfect replica of him. He had red skin and inky eyes, with sharp little teeth just as I remembered. The last time I'd seen him, he'd been busy transforming himself into an electrical ball of energy in order to escape my bowie knife. You're a badin? I asked. Is this a joke? The creature who looked like cloth glanced about, and he snarled with rage, reaching out and flipping a switch. It did nothing to change the image. He glared at me, and he looked around again. Then he stared at E.P., and understanding swirled in his dark eyes. You have always proved a troublesome beast, cloth or a badin said to me. I should have destroyed you the first day I laid eyes on your repugnant form. Yeah, what can you do? I asked. These things happen. His eyes narrowed with anger. I don't get it, Cloth, I said. How can you be a badden, and how can you have trillions of cargs willing to do your bidding? Or have the Jelk seen the way the wind blows and turned traitor to our universe? Cloth straightened, no doubt trying to regain what little dignity he could. You are destined to lose, he said. N7 spoke up, his voice coming through his helmet speakers. I do not believe the personage we're viewing is or was the original Abaddon. I have heard both beings speak, and I have kept internal recordings. Their voice patterns and manners are different. I believe Cloth has impersonated Abaddon for the moment only. Earlier, we heard the real Abaddon. And seven, Cloth said in an oily voice. If you would win back my favor, shoot the upstart humans around you, starting with Creed Beast. And seven did no such thing, but sat still, waiting. The last time I saw your ugly mug, I said. You were burning a hole through my battle jumper. Your battle jumper, Cloth said. You, you pirate, he spat. You stole it from me, and you will repay for that a thousand times over. I will recoup my losses. Sure you will, I said. But anyway, as I was saying, you floated away as an energy creature. I'm wondering how you went from there in Sigma Draconis to wherever it was that you found the Kargs. How did you find these fiends, anyway? A vicious smile curved Cloth's lips. I find it delightful that you are ignorant on so many matters. Surrender to me, beast, and I shall enlighten you. Why did you just pretend to be a badin? I asked. Did you think you could fool us? Cloth continued smiling. But you don't like that question? I asked. Why not try this one for size? Why do our biosuits work so well in hyperspace? Did you foresee the coming of the cogs? Or is it funnier than that? 
Did they capture you and force you to rematerialize into a body? Are you their slave, perhaps? You are doomed, Cloth whispered. Are the Jelk working for the Kargs? I asked. Is that it? What profit do you gain if the space-time continuum invaders destroy everything in our universe? You know so little, Cloth said in an evil voice. Yes, I delight in watching you stretch your thoughts as you attempt to encompass reality. Surrender immediately, Creed Beast, and you can regain my good favor. The Kargs can use someone like you. The Kargs, eh? I said. That's interesting. It's not the Jelk who can use me, but the invading Kargs. I'm back to thinking you've sold out to everyone, even your own kind. His smile slipped for just a moment. Believe what you wish, Cloth said, and he put the smile back into place. But it seemed forced now. You know what I really think? I said. You lost once to me, and when you gathered new flesh to yourself, you fell into Karg hands. How that happened, I don't know. Yet. That makes this funny, and you know why? Instead of running the show like you used to, the great and greedy Shah Cloth has become a slave to the Kargs. You're running scared, Cloth, and I like seeing it. If you... Shut up for a minute while I tell you what's going to happen, I said. I'm still hunting for you, Cloth. I'm still going to make you float a second time, and then I'm going to use a special weapon that will fry your energized self into nothing. There is no such weapon. That isn't what E.P. told me, I said. Who? asked Cloth. I jerked a thumb at the relic. The Forerunner artifact has told me all about you, Cloth, and it has given me the weapon I'm talking about. This is outrageous, Cloth said heatedly, and his words seemed directed at the artifact. How could you tell such a low-order creature about the energy ray? As E.P. began to vocalize, I cut the connection, and the hollow image vanished. I did not give Commander Creed information about such a ray, E.P. said, but it was too late. Cloth was offline and didn't know the information. I rounded on E.P. What's the deal? How come you tried to calm down, Cloth? You would not understand, E.P. said. Try me. No, E.P. said. This is not the right time for it. Uh-huh, I said, unconvinced. How is it you know who Cloth is? The knowledge is unremarkable, E.P. said. I am Orange Tamika's most sacred relic. As such, I have heard of Cloth's invasion attempts into various systems, particularly the Altair star system. Is Cloth really a badden? I asked. Your android drew the correct conclusion, E.P. said. Cloth attempted to impersonate a badden. Do the Kargs know who the Jelk are? I asked. Commander Creed, E.P. said. I believe you should worry about breaking into the Karg lines instead of querying me about old history. Do you know where the aliens are setting up their lines? Do you wish to view a 3D map of the strategical situation? E.P. asked. Yes, I said. E.P. swiveled, and another beam flashed against a tube car wall. This map showed the center of the planet with the former Altair object floating in a monstrously huge chamber, like a chocolate center buried in the middle of a Tootsie Pop. I'd seen the donut-shaped artifact before as a Jelk assault trooper. I understood its size and realized it floated in a titanic area. That was interesting. Before the huge and final chamber, the Kargs blocked the corridors with thick red clots of color. That meant thousands, tens of thousands of Kargs. If I'd had my entire Earth Commando army with me, I might have been able to battle through the enemy. 
with a partly two thousand troopers and several hundred lochars, I didn't see any way through. I couldn't believe it. We'd made it this far, and now... this. I glanced at E.P. What was its game? Had the relic helped bring us this far, and then given us an insolvable problem in order to see how Earthlings reacted? Are the Karg 3D representations similar to those you showed us previously near the surface? I asked. They are an exact and equal representation, E.P. said. How many Kargs do you estimate stand between us and the Altair object? I asked. Fifty-four thousand and increasing, the Relic said. Fifty-four thousand, Rollo said. We can't fight through that. What other choice do we have? I asked. We exchanged glances with each other, everyone no doubt realizing the hopelessness of the situation. May I ask the Relic a question? N7 asked. Be my guest, I said. E.P., our android said. Are there any armories nearby that might hold exotic forerunner weaponry? Ah, E.P. said as if thinking. Why, yes, there is. You're kidding, I told the relic. No, I speak truths or the truth, E.P. said. I never lie. Why didn't you say something about it earlier, then? That is an interesting question, E.P. said. As I desire your victory, and it would have been good for you to know about the weaponry. The answer is I do not know why I kept silent. Perhaps an alien virus has damaged memory cores. I wanted to howl. Instead, I closed my eyes, thinking. I needed to ask the right questions. That seemed clear. Opening my eyes, I said, Do the Kargs have this weaponry, too? I do not know, E.P. said. But I do not believe so. How far is the armory to the Kargs? I asked. I will show you on the map. The artifact did. It looked to be several kilometers from their most upward outpost. The Kargs might find the armory if it's that close to their positions, I said. Commander, E.P. said, On further contemplation, I feel I should inform you that the weaponry likely cannot help you. It is ancient battle gear, primarily suited to the first ones. I do not believe it has been used in millennia. Great. More curveballs. We're all out of options, E.P., you said 54,000 cargs with growing numbers await us. Soon they will have 100,000 in position and then 200,000. We have to attack now. I shook my head. It's too bad Venturi and the other Lohars couldn't have listened to my original idea and used T-missiles, letting a nuclear holocaust solve the problem. The relic dipped and lifted several times, with more lights than ever flashing in odd sequences. Wrong, Commander, E.P. finally said. Such an act would have been a crime against reality. Why? I asked. The Forerunner artifact is just a machine. A machine, yes, E.P. said. But much more than just. Why couldn't the Relic talk plainly for once? If the Oracle was anything like this... Tell us about the weaponry. I said. I distrusted the little forerunner. It had been wrong too many times. Then the thing began to talk. Chapter 29 Despite the Karg's nearness to the armory, we beat them to it. The main reason was that the aliens didn't know to march there. The Kargs waited in their selected chambers and corridors, no doubt creating the perfect defense. To make it even worse for us, new Kargs disembarked from their tube cars and continually added reinforcements. Two thousand assault troopers and roughly three hundred Lohar legionaries piled out at the last station. Here all the corridors shined with a hurtful radiance. 
Even with our polarized visors, we squinted, and splotches danced before our eyes. The hallways were bigger than ever, and the chambers massive beyond belief. It was like walking through a museum, with strange, crystalline shapes towering around us. We passed rooms covered with pink sands and deep, cobalt-colored wells of slowly sloshing mercurial liquid. We were near the center of the planet. In several chambers we saw metal walls beating like hearts. I found that incredibly disturbing. Was the planet alive? If it wasn't, even if it was, this was an alien place. I don't think the first ones had been humanoid in any manner. We marched, and E.P. still refused to explain the exact nature of the weaponry. I think he felt we needed to see it to believe. Finally, we reached thick vault hatches. E.P. spoke in high speech, and I began to notice many hisses in his words, like a snake. At the end of the sequence, the hatch dilated open, and we entered a great storage room with floaters made for giant creatures. Sprouting around them were more towering crystals pulsating with steady red lights. N7 glanced at a wrist monitor. It had tiny numerals glowing on its screen. It's hotter in here by ten degrees, the android informed me. Where's the weapon? I asked the relic. E.P. lifted out of Ella's arms and floated to a large crystal box. The thing measured approximately two feet by two. It also had knobs on one side, with exotic imagery within it that eerily pulsed just like the towers. There were small handholds on the box that tentacles or centipede legs could have easily grasped. Is that one of the weapons? I asked, pointing at the crystal box. No, E.P. said. That allows the proper application of the weapons and a nullification of others. How about telling it to us plainly for once? I said. You have such primitive minds, E.P. said. I keep forgetting. This machine produces a ten-score continuity field. Hold it right there, I said. What does that mean? Put simply... An active continuity field means guns and lasers, grenades, and other technological weapons will become inoperative. Or said another way, while under the field's influence, such weapons will not fire or explode. I laughed harshly. Why had I ever let myself be talked into listening to the stupid relic? The box looks too heavy to throw, so I don't get it. How does having this field help us in the slightest? I should think that would be obvious, E.P. said. We carry the emitter with us and create the continuity field. I already got that part, I said. Once we create a continuity field, meaning we can't fire our weapons, the Kargs can slaughter everyone by shooting their bullets and beams into the field to kill us. No, no. E.P. said. Their bullets and beams will no longer be able to race at speed through the field. The continuity mechanism renders that impossible. Okay, I said, wondering what kind of physics produced such an effect. That's a little better, I suppose. But I'm still not seeing it. That means we'll be down to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. The Kargs can simply overwhelm us with numbers. Certainly there is that possibility, the relic said. I groaned aloud, wanting to bang my forehead against a wall. After so many disappointments, why did I insist on thinking that E.P. was more than an idiot savant, with the accent on idiot? This was yet another of its boondoggles. The relic floated from us. Like a dog watching a running cat, my desire to blast away with a rifle became intense. You must observe, E.P. said. I will now show you the second part of the process. I relaxed my grip on the rifle, grumbling, what now, as I followed him to an alcove. 
The relic floated into a side area, and a crystal wall slid back to reveal hundreds of the brightest sticks I'd ever seen. Each of them had paper-thin wedges on one end. What the hell? I asked. I hope you're not telling me these are your great forerunner weapons. It must be that you lack understanding, E.P. said. The weaponry is fashioned from obdurate tin, an ultra-dense substance with a monofilament edge. What's a monofilament edge? A single-linked atom chain of obdurate tin on the cutting edge expanding finally to the wedge you see, E.P. said. Nothing known to forerunner science can resist such an edge. It is the sharpest object you will ever see. I suggest you pick one up. I glanced at the others piled behind me, shrugged and climbed into the alcove. Beware the edge, E.P. said. They are utterly unforgiving. By edge, I said. Do you mean the end of the wedge with the thickness of paper? Precisely, E.P. said. Gingerly, I wrapped my bio-suited hands on the other end of the stick. I grunted, surprised at its weight. This thing is heavy, I said. It is ultra-dense, as I originally informed you, E.P. said. The entire shaft is composed of obdurate tin. Come again? I asked. Lead is heavier than balsa wood, Rollo said, who must have understood. Maybe obdurate ten is heavier than lead. Countless times heavier, E.P. said. Bunching my shoulders, I heaved the forerunner space axe upright. Then I chopped with the wedge, the axe head. It sheared through the floor with amazing ease. In that second, I saw it. The first ones had gripped the continuity field box, creating a zone where high-tech weapons wouldn't work. Not guns, lasers, bombs, nothing. Then they waged combat with obdurate ten-made space axes, hacking each other or enemies to pieces. It was freaky, and it might actually give us an advantage over the cargs, at least for the initial contact. Okay, I said. This just might work, but these things are rather heavy. We're going to get tired swinging them. I suggest we use them in teams, N7 said. A trooper handles an axe until he's weary. Then he hands the weapon to his second. Once he becomes too fatigued, the second hands the axe to a third. By that time, the original soldier will have recovered some of his strength and stamina. Good thinking, I said. I shook my head, bemused at what we contemplated. The cargs have numbers. We have a continuity field and axis, making this a hand-to-hand -hand battle. I don't know how that helps a very few beat a horde, but let's give it a whirl. We found three of the continuity field devices and four hundred space axes. Two thousand troopers divided by four hundred gave us five wielders per weapon. Seeing that we had three CF devices, I decided to make this a three-pronged or three-corridor attack. The Lohars would split into one hundred legionaries per attack group. They elected to remain outside the continuity fields and act as observers and help keep in radio contact. No radio worked in the continuity field, so we had to devise simple hand messages to give each other. Even though we were under a hard time schedule, I believed we needed to practice. We did, for forty-five minutes. In that time, seven troopers died, cutting themselves or another with the axe. The slightest touch with the wedge edge cut deeply, shearing biosuits. These thin stick axes were dangerous. Finally, as cargs began arriving in our tube train station, we advanced to combat, but not before booby-trapping our station. Ten minutes later, we heard a thunderous explosion. There's no turning back now, I said. The station is gone. We can only go ahead. 
We marched through the alien tunnels for our battle with destiny. I gripped one of the axes, resting the haft on my shoulder. I'd done many strange things this past year and a half, but I hadn't gone into battle against aliens from another universe while trusting to ancient weaponry. I imagined my ancestors on Earth had fought like this, with swords and axes, I mean. I grinned, and I wondered if I'd thought of everything. We had plenty of space between troopers. I nodded. I used to play many war games as a kid. The old board games with cardboard counters and dice on a hexagonal grid map. I remembered this one on Ancients' Battles. I'd read how Greek phalanx soldiers had more hoplites per square foot than Roman legionnaires. The hoplite held a spear and could fight shoulder to shoulder, shoving a sharp tip at an enemy. The Roman had needed more space, even though he'd wielded a smaller weapon, the gladius, a two-foot short sword. The Roman needed room to swing without worrying about hitting his comrade. The Gallic barbarians, with their six-foot broadswords, had needed even more room between warriors, and thus his battlefronts had lesser density than even the legionary cohort did. Well, for the coming fight, we space axemen would need Gallic room to swing these nifty first-one weapons. That meant cargs could possibly outnumber us as they attacked shoulder to shoulder, using their rifle barrels and knives to jab at our faces. Cargs! a trooper shouted. Turn on the continuity field, I ordered. And good luck. Almost immediately the world turned metallic gray with black shimmering motes drifting everywhere as our continuity fields spread outward from the first one box. The field encompassed the troopers to my right and left. I heard harsh breathing and realized it was me. In a few seconds the first cargs showed up, or we marched to them. The alien creatures lay on their torsos or fired from behind crystal monuments. Here was the moment where I figured everything would fall apart for us. There would be some fine detail that E.P. had forgotten to explain, and whammo, the cargs would fill us with lead. I fully expected to die in a hail of bullets. Nothing of the kind happened. One or two cargs shook their rifles. Another actually twisted his weapon around and peered down the barrel. I couldn't believe it. The cargs had idiots on their side, too. I shouted, and even though I'd told my troopers not to charge, I ran at the aliens with my axe held up high. A karg shoved off the ground and held up his rifle to block my stick-like axe. The shaft was heavy like a sledgehammer, though, and the axe and handle were ultra-dense. The intensely sharp wedge edge sheared through the karg rifle, the cone-like alien head and part of the body. Black blood gushed out, some of it washing onto my chest. I stepped forward, slipped on the blood, and fell hard. Even as I went down, I knew the deadliest hazard came from my own axe. I made sure to keep that edge away from me. I thudded onto my back, and a carg scuttled toward me. He might have made it, but my neighbor saw my dilemma and raced near. His axe chopped the carg in half. It was beautiful, glorious, and a bloody mess. I learned that a deadly figure-eight weave worked best. I hacked, chopped, gored, gutted, slipped, and slid for fifteen panting minutes. We waded through cargs. We hacked apart big dogs. Occasionally, one of the troopers went down to a rush of cargs. We lost the most men that way, as our own axes sliced a trooper on the bottom of a pile of tentacle-striking cargs. Finally, finding that I could hardly raise the axe anymore, my replacement tapped me on my shoulder. I gave him the axe and went to the back of the line. Five soldiers per axe. Not one of the first one weapons broke. I didn't think anything could snap a handle in half or chip an obdurate ten blade. How many did we kill? Saul slew his thousands and David his tens of thousands. We slew tens of thousands, and we advanced through the carg lines toward the great forerunner object.
I recalled how in the Middle Ages well-armored knights with the best swords and horses could wade through enemy lines, especially if the enemy were pitchfork-armed peasants. Cortez and his Spanish conquistadors had also done likewise through Aztec armies. They'd had a few cannons and crude matchlock guns. Mostly they had armor and Toledo steel swords. Their Indian foes had obsidian chip blades and cotton armor. We had a continuity field, the sharpest axes of two universes, symbiotic suit strength and neurofiber speed. Here, in this place, it proved to be the winning combination. Yeah, they whittled us down. The Kargs had been doing that the entire time. The Lohars had to join us in the continuity field, and we lost contact with the other two attack columns. Ours finally waded through the enemy, and I motioned scouts to look outside the gray field of drifting black moats. The scouts returned to us, signaling the all-clear. Let's finish this, boys, I said. We maneuvered for one of the main corridors and hit the Kargs from behind. That freed the second attack column. We did the same for the third group, and now the last of the assault troopers made it through enemy lines. After several hours of constant combat, our continuity field finally went down. The grayness fled, and the brilliance of the inner planet struck. I cried out at the bright pain stabbing my eyes. A few moments later... With my gloves over my visor, I found it had polarized and I could see again. We ran down the corridor and came to what I can only call a giant air moat. Before us was space, lots of it. But in the distance I spied the forerunner artifact spinning slowly like a giant gyroscope. We had reached the center of the portal planet. Chapter 30 we nailed crystalline ropes to the metal floor, then we slid the rest of the way down. Yeah, the gravity tugged us that way, although in my humble opinion it shouldn't have done so. Most of the mass was above us now. I'm sure you're familiar with the old Arthur C. Clarke quote about extremely high tech seeming like magic to ignorant grunts like us. This place seemed magical, but in a weird, grim way. Some of the surprising magic had helped, but most had hurt. I slid down the long rope, the thing slippery in my bio-suited hands. I looked around as I traveled. There was lots of open space, with milky strands floating in the methane atmosphere. I wrapped my legs around the rope, trying to generate greater traction. For some freakish reason, radio waves didn't work far in this place. I couldn't communicate with those in the corridors anymore. Hard radiation must have been hitting me. My bones ached, and there was a copper taste in my mouth. The former Altair object had a black hole in its center. Always these black holes. I was sick of them. Finally, using my torso, hands, and legs, I almost brought myself to a halt. I slid slower in any case, and I could see the end of the rope approaching, around fifty feet from the great turning artifact below. The thing was silvery bright, and I thought to spy a cluster of buildings in the inner ring. Get ready, Creed, old buddy, I told myself. You have one more drop to make. I slid off the end of the rope, and then I fell toward the rotating surface. I gained speed heading toward terminal velocity. The metallic surface loomed bigger, and it came even faster. I managed to keep my legs aimed down, and I hit, absorbed the best I could, and let my knees buckle. I slammed down onto my chest, and the force knocked the air from my lungs. My legs hurt as if they'd broken. Maybe someone rolled me then. I don't know. Commander Crete, can you hear me? Answer, please, if you can. I opened my eyes, peering at a trooper who had come down before me. By the voice, it was Dimitri. What is it? I whispered. What's wrong now? The Cossack laughed, and he slapped me on the shoulder. 
I wish he hadn't done that. It made me twist in pain. I need your help, Commander, Dimitri said. Cards are coming from the other side. I groaned as I sat up and I looked around. I could see more troopers sliding down the ropes. With Dimitri were twenty members of his Zagoon. We were the advance force, the scouts. Let's do this, I said. Despite the aches and pains and a throb in my left knee, I limped along the outer hull of the artifact. Its bulk shielded us from the black hole and hopefully from the worst of the radiation. As we ran, bounded really like old-time moon astronauts, I unslung my laser rifle. We'd been saving them. Now it was time to use the bonkoofs. As if we moved on a mini-world, cargs appeared on the short horizon, and a firefight started. We threw ourselves prone and sighted the lasers. Then we began to slaughter cargs, and the reason proved simple. The black hole in the center of the torus affected each bullet's flight path just enough. This close to the singularity, the gravity had a disproportionate effect on the small objects. The bullets kept turning inward toward the black hole, and the Karg intellect, at least that of its soldiery, proved insufficient to grasp the concept. It told me others must program them for battle. The codes called for specifics in targeting, I'm guessing, which the Kargs continued to do even in this hostile environment. The last battle was the easiest and as more and more troopers landed on the Taurus, we drove the Kargs into headlong retreat. Finally, we swept them from the artifact. At my command, snipers knelt and readied their bankus for distant shots. Across the vast space, Kargs gathered at their corridor openings. Hot beams sliced into them. Some Kargs tumbled in. They were dead lemmings falling down an alien cliff. The others piled before the opening, so the cargs behind had to yank them out of the way in order to get their turns to die. By this time, over half the surviving troopers had made it onto the Taurus. Using relays of Earth soldiers like a Radio Pony Express, we passed messages from one location to the next. Soon I held a strategy conference with N7, Ella, and EP. Now what are we supposed to do? I asked the little relic. We must reach the main controls, E.P. said. I nodded. I had a bad idea I knew where those controls were located. You mean the tiny city on the inner edge? I asked. Precisely, E.P. said. What about radiation? I asked. Isn't it obvious? E.P. asked. You use the continuity field to block it from harming you. I suppose that made sense. And Seven spoke up. Isn't there a danger the continuity field will interfere with the black hole? Wouldn't that have a deadly impact on all of us? Ah, E.P. said in its thinking voice. Why, yes, you are correct. You cannot employ the continuity field, Commander. Doing so will destroy the object. I silently counted to three before asking, Do you know how to set the coordinates so the object can take us back to our universe? No, E.P. said. That is far beyond my capacity. I thought the relic had said before it could pilot us home. I shrugged. Maybe it was better this way. I didn't want to trust the relic as an interdimensional pilot. Still, E.P.'s lack created a problem. So, who exactly can set the coordinates? I asked. The Altair object will know, E.P. said. You're not telling me the thing we're standing on can communicate like you, I said. Not like me, no, E.P. said. But yes, it can communicate. It is older than I am by many cycles. How many Earth years is that? I asked. Well over two thousand. What? I feel it is time I confessed, E.P. said. 
I braced myself for the worst. The Altair object is a primary, the relic said, while I am a secondary. I frowned. Is that supposed to be important? It is everything. Lights played a fast sequence upon E.P.'s shell. Come, it is time to discover if the primary will reject you or not. I knew it couldn't be this easy. No, there always had to be one more thing. Now we had to talk to the big forerunner object, not just the little runt who seldom got things right. I wondered if the Lohars knew secrets about forerunners that could aid us. It turned out that N7 had similar thoughts. Perhaps we should summon Dr. Sant, our android said. He may possess information we will need. I would advise against that, Ella said. I have a feeling it's important we keep the Lohars away for now. I studied the Russian scientist. E.P. had rayed a pink mind beam at Ella. Now more than ever, that made me suspicious. Why don't you want Lohars near? I asked. Acceptance by a primary is critical, Ella told me. I wasn't sure if those were her thoughts or our relics. How far could I trust Ella about the Forerunners anyway? I didn't know, and I didn't like that. Not here at the end. Ella, you stay with the others. N7, you're coming with me. No, Ella said. I aimed my visor at her, waiting for a reason. Ah, uh, Ella said. You should take more humans along. I think that's important. Was she right? I glanced at N7 and then at E.P. I didn't know enough to make an informed decision, so I went with my gut. Not this time, I told Ella. Rollo and Dimitri should stay here on the outer hull. The Kargs aren't finished trying to storm this place. Keeping the artifact here is everything for our enemies. I don't know whom else I want with me in the Forerunner City. Normally I'd take you, but... Ella stiffened, although she said, You cannot trust me. I agree. E.P. has tampered with my thinking. You're right to leave me here. Add your laser to the firing line, I told her. Or keep an eye on Sant and the Lohars. I don't want any of them following us. I must protest, E.P. said. I wish for the woman to join us. Nope, I said. That you want her along means it's probably a bad idea. It's just going to be the three of us now. I thought the relic would argue. Instead, E.P. bobbed up and down, and it finally submitted to my decision. We set out immediately, heading inward. Maybe this was the last lap, with three unique beings traveling toward the cluster of buildings on the inner ring. We had a heavily modified N-series mining android, an ancient forerunner construct, and an ex-con to decide the fate of our universe. Crazy, huh? While thinking about it, my left knee gave another grimacing throb. I favored it, enduring the pain. As I trudged along the continuing curve, finally bringing the black hole into sight, harder radiation struck. It made my bio-armor shift along my skin. And my jaw began hurting. And I wondered if I was killing myself doing this. I feel it, E.P. said in what sounded like a contented voice. What do you feel? I asked. Renewed power, the relic said. The Altair object is at maximum capacity and is bleeding our bandwidth-specific energy. Ah, it is good. Then Ella was right earlier, I said. The object has been feeding or powering up through the destruction of the Karg universe. The trans-dimensional hole is for its benefit. The Karg's coming through is just an unforeseen afterthought. 
In a manner of speaking, I suppose you are correct, E.P. admitted. Everything soon became worse along the inner curve. My eyesight dimmed, and each step made me shiver. My symbiotic suit shuddered more and more often. It wouldn't be long before the heavy radiation killed both the suit and me. Commander Creed? E.P. said. I ran a swollen tongue over my loosened teeth. What is it? I whispered. Why have you failed to answer my latest queries? E.P. said. What are you talking about? The relic has addressed you several times in the last minute, N7 said. I guess I'm not hearing so well anymore, I said. Is there a problem? E.P. asked. I laughed hoarsely. My throat had become raw. One area hurt like a razor every time I swallowed. The hard radiation from the black hole is killing both me and my suit. Ah, E.P. said. I had forgotten your weakness. I will inform Holgatha. Who's that? I asked. I thought you knew. E.P. said. The Altair object was originally known as Holgatha. Just like other primaries, the artifact prefers a male pronoun. I shall inform him of your predicament. I don't know how the little relic communicated with the big one. Radio waves didn't travel far here. But almost immediately I began to feel better. Soon my bio-suit no longer squirmed, but settled down in a normal manner. What just happened? I asked. Why do I feel less sick? Holgatha has been bathing you and N7 in healing rays, E.P. said. We're almost there. I saw that our relic was right. The inside of the torus was a golden color with peculiar script running on the inner surface. I hadn't been able to see it earlier. The alien letters were huge. I wondered what they said. Then I studied the buildings. They were low and squat, with fluted edges and domes. They almost seemed primitive, like stone-built houses or Stonehenge in England. Their size was deceptive, though. The things were huge. As we neared, I saw they lacked doors or windows of any kind. How will we gain entrance? I asked. We will walk through the walls, E.P. said. That's possible? I asked. Here it is. Okay, why not? I'd come to the land of Oz, apparently. It still surprised me that the little relic was right. We reached a targeted dome, and E.P. sank through the wall. Was this thing a giant hologram, then? I clenched my teeth and pushed my hand through. I felt resistance, and that made things worse. This wasn't a hologram. I was actually pushing my hand through matter, and I didn't like it. How was it possible? I had no idea. The wall had greater resistance than water, but I could force my hand deeper into it. Then I took a deep breath, and I found myself passing through a translucent wall, an eerie, heart-pounding feeling. After half a minute of slow travel, I plopped through an inner wall to find myself in a low-ceilinged chamber. It looked bare, with a dull light seeming to come from every direction. N7 joined me, but there was no E.P. I felt betrayal until I wondered if the relic had gotten lost. It wouldn't have surprised me. Out of the floor, a malleable substance oozed upward, creating a small bench for each of us. I sat down, and so did N7 on his furniture. Hello, I said, using my outer speakers. The wall before me vibrated and I heard a growling voice say, You may remove your helmet in safety. I have created a breathable atmosphere for you. I checked my HUD. 
and found the tiny room indeed had an earth-air mix at seventy-three degrees. What the heck? I was sick of wearing this thing anyway. With a twist of my helmet, I pulled it off. The sweet aroma struck me immediately. Slowly, I let the tension flow out of my shoulders. I heard a noise, turned, and saw N7 removing his helmet. I'd almost forgotten what it feels like to expel my air and not have to sniff my own breath, I said. Agreed, N7 said. Who are you? The wall asked with its deep vibration. I witnessed the wall pulsating like a larynx. The center area turned a lighter color while that happened. Yeah, it was freaky, but I told myself to go along with anything right now. I was so far out of my depth that I might as well play it straight. I'm Commander Creed, I said. This is N7, an android in human likeness. We've come from a different universe. I know where you originate. Are you Holgatha? I asked. Impressive. You know me. Yes, I am indeed him. And you're also a forerunner object or artifact? I asked. That is self-evident, Holgatha said. Are you aware that your being here in the portal planet has opened a pathway for the Kargs? I asked. I am quite aware of it, of course. Does that bother you at all? I asked. Why should it bother me? This is one of my many functions. To deny function is to deny self. Great. The freak was a philosopher. I should have expected it to be an egghead. You're pretty smart, I said. That is not self-evident. Holgatha said. But it should be a rational conclusion from the evidence. Your reasoning so far shows solid logic chains. Coming from you, that's high praise, I said. Thanks. Gratitude is unnecessary. I merely state data. I kept plowing ahead, but I felt the beginning edges of anger heating my words. Here's a fact for you. I said. The Kargs plan to break into our universe and destroy everything that is non-Karg. You speak as if I am unaware of the obvious. Your tones also imply displeasure with me. Surely you realize that conquest by one organism over another is a simple datum of existence. What if the Kargs begin to threaten you? I asked. You're non-Karg. Aren't you worried about extinction? Finally, you disappoint me, Holgatha said. I suppose it was self-evident you would do so. You are inferior in ability compared to me. Your latest question shows suboptimal reasoning. I hereby declare that as the first strike against you. Attend my words closely, human. I have obviously transferred from one location in a universe to another in a quite different place. If the Kargs overrun your universe and attempt my destruction, I shall simply go elsewhere. Ergo, I have no worries concerning extinction. Do you wish, then, for continued existence? I asked. That is the second strike against you. The fact that I fled the Altair star system shows— Whoa, 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 I said. Back it up a minute. And Seven leaned forward, tugging at my sleeve. Likely he did it as a warning. I ignored him. After all that we'd been through, I was pissed off with the big artifact. Playing it safe seemed like a dead end. This was gusto time. Are your nonsense words directed at me? Holgatha asked. That's strike one against you, I said. There was a pause before Holgatha said, What is the meaning of your outburst? You must be more specific, I said. Such imprecision is your second strike. 
Are you attempting to annoy my circuitry? Holgatha asked. No, I said. I'm just showing you what a pain in the ass your style of questioning and speech are. Here we've come all this way to speak to you, and you act like you're too big to speak to your betters. This is inconceivable, Holgatha said. You must retract your statements at once. In no way are you my superior. I am adamant on this. Creed, N7 said. I suggest a different... I twisted around and stared at N7, finally winking at him. N7's choir-boy image had never been stronger. He sat stark still, staring at me, until finally he nodded once, a sharp thing. Even so, I thought to see fear in the android's eyes. I faced forward again, deciding on my approach. Holgatha didn't strike me as much different from E.P. I had a genie on my hands, a powerful one. Showing weakness or indecision seemed like a mistake. Therefore, I plunged ahead. Look, Helgatha, I said. I know certain truths are always difficult to face. That's the nature of life. I have to let you in on a secret, though. You cannot possibly know more than I do, Holgatha said. This is a much different era from the ones you're used to, I said. You've been in the Altair system for far too long, letting the Lohars guard you. It's made you rusty. That is false. The Lohars have not guarded me, but shown awe at my being. I have observed their strict religiosity toward me. I find their deference more congenial than your flood of inanities. Are you sure their all was directed at you? I asked. They figured you were touched by the Creator. That is imprecise. But given your limited intellect, close enough to the mark. How old was this thing? Had it been around during the beginning? Say, Holgatha, have you ever seen the Creator? No. Well, that was curt and to the point. Did the first one see the Creator? I asked. Not to my knowledge, Holgatha said. Is there a Creator? N7 asked. Holgatha paused, finally saying, My designers and builders believed so. I have awaited the cycles and millennia for conclusive proof. Is that why you came here? I asked. I do not understand your reasoning, Holgatha said. Can you be more specific? Do you wish to unleash an apocalypse on our universe in order to see what will happen? I asked. Do you believe that will bring the Creator into sight? For the first time, I find your reasoning interesting. There was a pause before Holgatha added, I wonder if some of my oldest subroutines subscribe to such a notion. I will investigate. How long will that take? I asked. Do you mean in your time? Asked Holgatha. Sure, I said. Twenty to twenty-five years, the artifact said. So your internal investigation is going to take quite a bit of your, uh, I hesitated. Just how touchy was the artifact? I don't want to be imprecise, and I don't mean to demean you by implying you're a computer. But will your twenty-year analysis absorb the majority of your computational abilities? Eh? Uh -huh. Holgatha asked. Did you ask another question? I have begun to assemble my Inquisitor files. I licked my lips. Interesting. Interesting, Holgatha said. There is a new development occurring even now. I stiffened. That didn't sound good. Commander Creed, Holgatha said. It appears there is an incoming message for you. The technology is highly advanced, 
better than anything you possess. I will relay this onto a wall. Yes, this could possibly prove enlightening. I will delay my beginning Inquisition to observe. I was about to ask Holgatha what his gibberish meant when a round window about the size of my arms, held together in a circle, appeared in a wall. A grainy, fuzzy image greeted us. I had a good idea who called, and this didn't surprise me. Had I been subconsciously expecting something like this? Commander Creed, the gravelly voice asked. This is him, I said. Are you Abaddon or Cloth? First there was silence. Then intense menace emanated from the temporary screen. Was it the half-hidden eyes? I'm not sure. But I wondered how I'd ever been able to let Cloth fool us he was Abaddon. The impression I got from this being was entirely different. The creature I spoke with... I could sense he'd lived in a hopeless universe for an eon of time. I see that despite all odds you have reached the interior of the ancient device, Abaddon said. Logic dictates that you are an extraordinarily lucky or an extremely resourceful individual. I have a place for someone like you. So do I, I said. It's called home. I'm about to go there. Do not be hasty, Abaddon said. There is more at stake here than you realize. I don't think so, but what do you have for me? Think well and deeply, Commander Creed. One way or another I will regain my original universe. And when I do, all life shall tremble before me. Original universe. It seemed that Abaddon had been born in our space-time continuum. Well, that was interesting, but not germane to the number one problem. You won't do squad if I can help it, I told him. I admire your success even as I hate it. Abaddon growled. It is a notable feat an anomaly and phenomena of rarity. Such should not be squandered on normality. Come, join me, and I will teach you how to destroy every enemy you ever had. Do you desire to see Cloth suffer for an age? I will give him to you, as well as the devices to make each phase of his torment one of enduring cruelty. I'd never heard a pitch like this, that's for sure. I can forgo hurting cloth if my universe survives your tender mercies, I said. I do not mean to insult such a one as you, Abaddon said. But I must know, and therefore find myself compelled to ask. Do you then believe in love, Commander Creed? I frowned. Why would Abaddon ask that, and in the way he did? Was he mocking me? I didn't like this. In fact, it was time to go. I've had a fun chat, I told him. Don't think you're not interesting, but... If you believe in love, Abaddon said in a silky voice, you would do well to listen to me. Why's that? I whispered. Observe, Abaddon said. The fuzzy images disappeared, revealing my sweet Jennifer dangling naked by two tentacles attached to her wrists. Behind her sat squat creatures with green, scaly skin. One held a long prod with two prongs, with sizzling energy flickering. By barely standing on her tiptoes, she could keep her shoulders from ripping out of their sockets. Jennifer, Abaddon said in his evil voice. Your lover is watching. My heart stopped as Jennifer slowly lifted her head. Her eyes were puffy and her lower lip cut so blood trickled. Crete, she whispered. My jaw dropped. 
I stared at her, and I knew what this monster was going to say. Jennifer, Jennifer, how did Clarks capture you? Do you believe in love, Commander Creed? The darkest voice in two universes asked. I didn't ask why he did this. I didn't answer him. I stared at Jennifer. Could I trade my universe for her? Could I trade myself? How would I go about making such a transfer? I'm... I'm sorry, I whispered. Please, Creed, she said. It hurts. It really hurts. I squeezed my eyes shut and bowed my head. I kept shaking my head back and forth. You can stop her pain, Abaddon said. All you must. Off, I said. Holgatha, turn this off. I will find you, Commander Creed, Abaddon said, and I could feel the hatred oozing from him. You are doomed. All you love is doomed unless you give yourself to me and leave the artifact in place. I couldn't look any more. I felt dreadful and awful. If I had been able, I'd have squared off against Abaddon with just my bowie knife in hand, if I had to. But it would never work out like that. I knew that much. This is your last chance to avoid a wretched fate. Abaddon said. I stood up, and although I found it almost impossible, I turned my back on the screen. Creed, Jennifer said a last time, and then it ended as Holgatha cut the connection. My knees buckled, and I thudded onto the bench. My gut seethed in turmoil. I'd failed in the most important area of a man. I hadn't protected my woman. Yeah, we drifted apart lately, but she'd still been my woman until I had told her otherwise. You do not desire further communication with Abaddon? Holgatha asked. No, I said in a dead voice. It has been my observation that Abaddon keeps his promises, Holgatha said. You could have risen high in his hierarchy and saved your woman pain and death. Is he a first one? I asked. That is a remarkable leap of logic, Holgatha said. The correct answer is that I do not know. My suspicions, however, run in the same direction. I nodded my hands into fists and I pressed my fists against my forehead. I had to think now more than ever. Yet all I could see in my mind's eye was Jennifer hanging like that, trying to keep up on her toes. Holgatha, I said slowly, forcing myself to concentrate on the present task. This seems like a bad location to do your internal computations and search your subroutines. I understand your illusions, your primitive psychological tricks. Surely even you must realize that I have grown weary of the Lohars. They can no longer teach me interesting tidbits. My present location is much preferable to the Altair system. Oh, Jennifer, it would have been better if you'd never met me. Listen, Holgatha, I managed to whisper. We're the new kids on the block, us humans. Maybe you can learn more stuff from being in our vicinity. I fail to see your reasoning. The Lohars tried to annihilate humanity and failed. The Jelg tried to make us their slave soldiers and failed even worse. Abaddon and his cargs beat the Lohars and then came within a hair's breadth of returning to our universe. Humans stopped that, too. You humans have not yet halted the invasion, Holgatha said. We will if you come with us, I said. Think about it. How many races have you found that survived such catastrophes one right after the other? 
Checking my data memories will take time. I get it, I said. You're well-rounded and full of information. Still, I think in recent history you'll find that Earth people are unique. That is a common supposition that each species believes about itself. Yeah, I suppose so. But how many individuals has Abaddon begged to join him, offering each top billing in his evil hierarchy? You have a point, Holgatha said. The number is minuscule. Are there any Lohars in that number? I asked. No. See what I'm saying? Yes, Holgatha said. I do. Despite your galling primitiveness, you have convinced me. We will transfer in twenty sims. How long is that in Earth time? I asked. There was a pause, a trembling under my feet. Then Holgatha spoke again. We have begun the tertiary countdown sequence. I suggest you remain seated. What? I asked. Two. One. Transfer, the great artifact said. Chapter 31 I awoke with my nose mashed against the floor. Groggily, I sat up. The benches were gone, and the temperature had definitely cooled. The air had a metallic odor, and the chamber was dimmer than I remembered. Hogatha? Oh, I asked in a strained voice. The wall no longer vibrated in answer. The place felt abandoned. Had the artifact already begun searching its subroutines? Did that mean the thing had effectively forgotten about us? I didn't like the implications. I put on my helmet and shook N7 awake. The android lifted his head, glanced around, and finally at me. What happened? he asked. Get your helmet on first, I said. He did. I think we'd better get through those walls while we can, I said. N7 was busy looking around. He stopped and faced me, and he nodded. We approached the farthest wall. I think it was the one we'd come through. I put my hand against it. The substance felt solid. I pushed. Slowly, my hand went into the wall. This was harder to do than the first time. I had the feeling if I didn't go now, I'd be trapped in the chamber, maybe for the next twenty years. The struggle into the wall left me winded, and twice I had to go around a blocked area. Finally, I forced myself past the outer shell, stumbling onto the inner surface of the artifact. I'm not sure what I expected. A laugh bubbled out of my throat. Stars. I saw stars everywhere. We were back in normal space somewhere. Motion caught the corner of my eye. I turned and saw that N7 stood beside me. We must hurry, the android radioed. Holgatha no longer bathes us with its healing ray. I felt it then. The black hole poured radiation at us, and nothing counteracted it. Together, N7 and I trudged for the outer hull. As I moved, I studied the stars. They seemed familiar. Then I recognized the Big Dipper. How close was I to the solar system? We must go faster, N7 said. We dared to bound, increasing our speed. Soon we stood on the outer hull. Nearby, prone and likely sleeping troopers lay on the surface. They had made it with us out of the portal planet. I recognize star patterns, N7 informed me. We are very near Earth's solar system. I used my HUD, switching to greater magnification as I studied space. There was a red planet, a sun, and it hit me. The realization where we were. That's Mars, I said, pointing at the planet. We're home. I laughed with glee. We'd done it. We had won. We'd actually beaten the Kargs. 
For a time, N7 gazed at various locations. He must have been using Zoom like me. You are correct, the android said. Do you see that object out there? He pointed into the distance. Finally, I saw it, a large, rocky asteroid. I believe our artifact orbited the planetoid. Yeah, I said. I see it. That is Ceres, N7 said. We are in the asteroid belt. I laughed again as the terrible tension oozed out of me. It was great to be home. Too bad that wasn't the end of the story. Yes, we'd beaten Abaddon and his cargs. Now trouble brewed in the solar system between the Lohars and the surviving humans. We were about to find out just how bad things had become. A few hours later, the radio messages began to reach us. First, they came from the Lohars on Mars. It turned out they'd build a base there and kept a fleet in orbit. Second, humans from the Earth Council asked us to state our names and the nature of our visit. From their questions, N7 concluded that interdimensional transportation created a noticeable anomaly. When the tourists appeared by a series, sensors near Mars and Earth had easily seen it. Announcing our names and victory created an instant stir. Soon both battle fleets started for Ceres. I had a bad feeling the two sides were about to go to war for possession of the artifact. Let me make this short and sweet. By constant communication with the two sides, we learned the score quickly enough. I should add that during the transfer, the assault troopers, the Lohar legionaries, and Dr. Sant remained on the outer hull. N7 and I had to wake up the first few. They woke up the rest. A head count showed we'd returned with 1,813 troopers, 237 Lohars, and one android. Minus the legionaries, that was the extent of my influence. Or so I believed. It turned out that the Lohar Emperor had balked at the price of the antibiological agents to scrub Earth. To balance the Imperial books, he'd sent warships to the solar system. I believe the Emperor wanted to put down the upstart humans and reabsorb the Lohar vessels I demanded as our payment for help. In any case, the Lohar and Earth flotillas raced toward Ceres and the Forerunner artifact. We waited on the outer hull, enduring in our bio-suits and the Lohars in their powered armor. I had a long conversation with Dr. Sant. He wanted to know everything that had happened when I communicated with the giant relic. On a hunch, I told him an edited story. Afterward, on a tight beam link, Sant spoke to the approaching Lohars. As he did, the surviving legionaries circled him, forcing me away. What do you think, Ella? I asked. Are the approaching Lohars going to kill us? How should I know? She asked. I wanted to tell her because of the pink mind ray. She'd become one of theirs, right? Instead, I kept silent. For a time, I gazed at the stars. They were so glorious, their patterns pleasingly familiar. We left our reality and had come home again. The fight should have been over. Couldn't the purple Tamika Emperor keep his word? Finally, I noticed Dr. Sant working his way toward me. The legionaries parted to let him pass. Commander Creed, Sant radioed. I approached him. The doctor let his visor clear so I could see his face. His features looked thinner than before. I did the same thing with my visor. We studied each other. Then the tiger smiled. I have spoken to Admiral Cyrus of Purple Tamika, Sant said. And? I asked. I informed the Admiral that you are the only living person to have entered the inner sanctum of the Forerunner object. Well, that's not strictly true, I said. And Seven joined me. Sant frowned, and his head twitched within his helmet. You must realize by now that androids do not count. Sure, I said. How could I have forgotten? 
Sant seemed to compose himself before saying, "'I have informed the Admiral that you learned the artifact's true name, and have spoken personally with it for quite some time.' It took me a second, but then I began to suspect what Sant implied. My interview with the artifact was a thunderclap for the Lohars. In their eyes, I must have become a prophet. I thought about that and asked, Did you know that the artifact wants humans and Lohars to work together? It actually said that? Sant asked. Absolutely, I said, without bothering to cross my fingers. The doctor studied me, eventually nodding. I will inform the Admiral. If you will excuse me. I did, and I began to wonder about my own side. The Lohars raced here, and so did Diana and Murad Bey. I hadn't heard anything from Loki. He seemed to have disappeared. I had the feeling Diana and Murad Bey had gotten rid of him. By my radio conversations, it sounded as if those two had a tight grip on the Earth fleet and government. In their eyes, did I represent a threat to their power? Did they come here to both claim the artifact and kill me? For a time, I strode along the outer hull, thinking deeply. Like fanning cards in a deck, I studied various options. For the next day and a half, my gut churned. I waited. We all did. Finally, I spotted bright dots in the distance. Those were the engine exhausts of the breaking Lohar warships. As the hulls of the actual starships began to appear, I spied the earth vessels spewing long, fiery tails. They'd had farther to travel. But they had come with harder acceleration and now braked with greater Gs. There were more talks via radio and laser links, more negotiations. Soon the two fleets orbited Ceres with the Forerunner object. So it was that four days after appearing in the solar system, I found myself in a nearly empty Lohar supply vessel. It would be neutral ground for the two sides. I walked through a steel corridor with N7, holding my helmet in the crook of my arm. I should have felt great. Instead, for the past few days, every time I closed my eyes, I had nightmares. I thought about Jennifer far too much. My right eye twitched, and nothing I'd done so far had stopped the tick. N7 glanced at me. He carried his helmet, too. His look asked a question. Are you ready for this? I hardened my heart as we approached the hatch. A Lohar in powered armor and an Earth soldier in space-suited gear stood guard. The human saluted me. The Lohar held his right arm stiffly like an old-style Roman. I nodded to each. The hatch opened and I entered the war zone, the conference room. On one side of the table sat Murad Bey with his swept-back hair. He wore a silver uniform with glittering rows of medals. Beside him sat Diana in golden attire. She gave me a stunning smile, but her eyes were hard and calculating. The Lohars had a bluff combat officer with a white nebula with purple trim pinned to his jacket. He guarded the admiral, a tall lady by the name of Saris. She sat as if someone had surgically inserted a steel rod in her spine. This meeting was deadly important, I knew. Yet it was difficult for me to engage fully. The situation felt surreal. I'd saved the universe and lost my girl. I'd lived under intense pressure for too long. Now the Lohars and humans squabbled like kids in a sandbox over who could pick up which shovel or plastic bale. I knew it was more important than that. If the Lohars decided to begin a war with us, they would likely win as they had more starships present. As soon as I sat, the questioning started. The others peppered me. Very quickly it must have become clear to them I was only half there. Probably in the Admiral's mind that helped solidify my profit label. After a time, Diana began giving me funny looks. 
I focused then. I wished Jennifer could have enjoyed peace and relaxation as I did. Why did the good people always have to pay the stiffest cost? Some sort of inverse cosmic rule, I suppose. Why did the Murad Bays, the Dianas, and the Commander Creeds survive? You know what? I said, deciding it was time to cut through the BS on both sides. The universe has won a singular victory. Lohars and humans working together closed the Great Portal. We halted the Karg invasion. The rest of their miserable race will die in their collapsing space-time continuum. But if the Jalk found a way to cross into hyperspace, the Admiral said. I held up a hand. Admiral Saris fell silent. Dr. Sant and I had told our story via radio many times to the others. Well, we'd told them most of the tale. It's how they knew about cloth. I suspect the Jelk was a renegade, I said. Just because Cloth joined the Kargs doesn't mean the rest of the Jelk Corporation did. Yes, Abaddon will seek a way to escape hyperspace. But I believe for our lifetime the great danger is over. We beat them. It seems clear the Kargs captured tigers, Diana paused. Excuse me, please, she said, glancing at the Admiral. I mean Lohars. The Kargs may have even captured a Lohar dreadnought. It's possible the transdimensional aliens have functional hyperspace technology. They would have used it earlier if they had it, I said. That isn't necessarily true, Diana said. Maybe Abaddon first wanted to get everyone out of their dying universe. Afterward, he would begin the invasion of ours. According to your testimony, he already has many ships in hyperspace. True, I said. But there are many universes. Even if he has the technology, he might not be able to find our particular space-time continuum. You may be right, Diana said. Yet, if Abaddon has the technology, the risk to our universe is still there. Of course, of course, I said. But until the risk materializes, I think we should consider the situation in our own backyard. I took a deep breath. We need a memorial to Lohar and human cooperation. I suggest we use the Forerunner object near Ceres as the basis of it. The stiff-backed admiral leaned toward me. I'm told you know the artifact's true name, she said. I do. I would love to hear the name, the Admiral said softly, with a fierce gleam in her eyes. In time, in time, I said. First we must realize what it means. What what means? the Admiral asked, puzzled. That the artifact chose this place, this system, I said. Yes, the Admiral asked. What is your point? Once, the artifact resided in the Altair star system, I said. It seemed content to rest under Lohar stewardship. Now it has come to our solar system. I do not think it did this because of any lack in the Lohars. Quite the opposite, in fact. I fail to understand your meaning, the Admiral said stiffly. You proved to be the perfect guardians, I said. Then why didn't the artifact return to the Altair system? The Admiral asked. Because you learned your lessons as it desired, I said. Now it is time to teach us humans about the Creator. The best way is for the great artifact to be here, reminding us of the days of yore. As a teaching tool, the artifact will let the Earthmen protect it. Yet we are young in understanding. We could use your help. I suggest that means you should aid us in protecting this most precious relic of the First Ones. What are you suggesting? the Admiral asked. I stared at Diana and looked into Murad Bey's cold eyes. The surviving assault troopers will take over the Lohar base on Mars. We've witnessed the artifact in action. We've seen its glory. 
so we will make the best guardians. I suggest, Admiral, that you leave us several powerful warships. Until you leave, we will recruit among the remaining humans to fill out the troopers to 5,000 elite soldiers and several elite-run war vessels. Under the Council's authority, of course, Diana said quickly. No, I said. I don't think so. We will be the Forerunner Guardians, acting as agents between humans and Lohars. Naturally, we expect the Emperor to sanction us under the Jade League. The Emperor has already spoken, the Admiral said. Humans aren't ready to enter the League. He's right, of course, I said. Humans aren't ready, but the Forerunner Guardians are. An interesting idea, the Admiral said. You will be a holy order of warriors. Yes, the Emperor might allow such as you into the League. I glanced at the Admiral and then resumed watching Diana and Murad Bey. I will be Earth's link to the League. Through me and my order I will protect Earth from other Jade League predators. You are wise, the Admiral said. You are indeed a prophet of the Creator. I make no such claims, I said. Yet the markings are clear, the Admiral said. I agree to your demands. What about you, Madam President? I asked Diana. Do you agree? A long round of questions and bargaining ensued. In the end, Diana and Murad Bey gave in to my demands. I got my base. I got several warships and the right to recruit assault troopers. I wasn't sure what the future held, but it looked like I was going to be in it for a while longer. My goal was simple and straightforward. I was going to give humanity the best leg up possible, even if I had to walk over Diana and Murad Bey to do it. I leaned back in my chair as the others continued to talk. Humanity had survived Abaddon and the Kargs. We'd survived the Jelk and the Lohars. Jennifer, my Jennifer, are you still alive? I shook my head. I didn't want to think about her or about Abaddon trying to break into our universe. We had won for the moment. Tomorrow, it would have to take care of itself. Meanwhile, I plan to get royally drunk for the next several months. Planet Strike Written by Vaughn Hepner Narrated by Christian Rummel Copyright 2014 by Vaughn Hepner Star Viking Extinction Wars Book 3 Written by Vaughn Hepner Performed by Christian Rummel Chapter 1 The alien didn't look like a bomb. He stood seven feet tall and resembled an upright tiger, with muscles bulging against his green one-piece. A breather covered his snout, but I could tell he snarled as he raced at me. The Lohar, that's what the tiger alien was called, possessed hands like a man. From the fingertips, titanium-tipped claws gleamed wetly. No doubt the Lohar meant to shred me from head to toe, leaving my blood splattered against the bulkheads. Me? I'm Creed. Commander Creed. I'd never liked my first name, so I didn't use it anymore. Neither did anyone else. I'd been inspecting the latest automated factory. This was the last of many imported from the Lohar Empire. The complex rested a few kilometers outside of Laramie, Wyoming or what was left of it, anyway. The Earth had died six long years ago, first nuked and then sprayed with a deadly bio-terminator. The automated factories were huge affairs, bigger than several old football stadiums combined. The Lohar Empire industrialists who had shipped this one to Earth had used seven freighters to bring it to the solar system. Tramp haulers had labored two entire months taking the sections from the parked freighters and setting them down in Wyoming. I'd kept track. It had taken 473 shuttle flights from orbit, 
A special force screen sealed the factory from the poisons presently floating through our planet's atmosphere. Incidentally, the industrialists' reps had left a month ago. The automated systems had run smoothly for two weeks. The giant plant was supposed to be empty. The tiger must have waited a month alone in here to make his attempt. I was part of the effort to rehabilitate the planet and save the final one percent of humanity. They lived in giant space freighters orbiting our dead world. Ever since we'd learned that aliens inhabited the Orion Arm with us, human survival had been one long uphill battle after another. These automated factories were helping to cleanse the poisons from Earth. The tiger roared. It was a deeply throaty sound, reverberating off the walls. His running bounds dramatically increased. It seemed as if he had springs in his legs. No doubt he had bionic enhancements. Yet Lohar supposedly abhorred such modifications to their bodies. They didn't even allow fillings in their teeth. Nevertheless, four more jumps would bring those claws to my throat. I held a forty-four Magnum, the same gun that had killed Princess Nii four years ago, the Purple Tamika Emperor's daughter-wife. She'd ordered the death of every human aboard the dreadnought Indomitable. My slugs had stopped the order and ensured the continuation of the mission to the portal planet. That's a long story, though. Maybe I'll tell it to you someday. As the Lohar charged me, I pulled the trigger three times. Boom, boom, boom. The shots were deafening within the confines of the corridor. The first slug whipped the head back even as half of it disintegrated in a spray of skull and blood. The second acted like a linebacker, stopping the Lohar's forward momentum. The third began to put him down. That's when the tiger ignited. His bones, skin, fur, blood, and one piece vanished in the titanic blast. The concussion and fireball billowed outward. I said a moment ago that Lohars were supposed to hate body modifications. The same didn't hold true for me. Now, it wasn't that I loved what the Jelk Corporation had done to me many years ago. It had helped me survive many alien battlefields, though. Just as good, the modifications had allowed me to turn the tables on someone called Shah Cloth. That gave us enslaved assault troopers a battle jumper, a spaceship, and began the road to human freedom. That's another long story we can save for a different time. I'd become Gorilla Strong through Steroid 68 injections and had become Cheetah Fast by having neuron fibers surgically implanted in my muscles. The Jelk Corporation had supplied all that at the beginning of my term of service. I also wore a bio suit, symbiotic second skin. My sweat powered the living tissues, allowing them to act as hardened armor on the outside and enhance my already considerable strength. The second skin didn't cover my face, and I could take the suit on and off at will. I wore a helmet with combat boots on my feet. The tiger exploded, vanishing from existence. The blast lifted me off the decking and hurled me two hundred meters rearward against a bulkhead. The back of my helmet cracked causing my consciousness to flutter. The cannonball strike also caused my body to deflect to the left. I bounced against another bulkhead, slammed against the decking, and found myself lying in a side corridor. It's possible that saved me from dying in the accompanying fireball. As I lay there, I sweated intensely, which helped to energize my symbiotic skin. At the same time, I wheezed for air. My chest hurt especially my ribs. My head spun, and splotches made my vision blotchy. At the moment, I couldn't remember if anyone had been standing behind me. Several Earth Council representatives had been on the inspection tour with me. A distant roar sounded. It iced my spine. Were more Lohars inside the automated factory? I contemplated rising to go and find out. Instead of acting on the thought, I expanded my lungs once again to pull down more air. The pain sent waves of nausea against my mind, threatening unconsciousness. What should I do? Another roar echoed in the distance. At least one more tiger lurked in the automated factory with me. You gotta get up, Creed, I told myself. 
Lying here is going to get you killed. My mind ordered my muscles to respond. They were still taking a vacation, complaining about how much they ached. I heard claws scraping against metal. It was a distinctive, frightening sound. In my mind's eye, I saw the Lohar striding down the twisted corridors. He would be hunched forward in a feral manner. No doubt his finger claws would flick in and out of their skin sheaths. If the tiger found me lying here, would he lean over and carefully slice my throat? Would he stomp on my face with his heel? Maybe he'd just explode, taking both of us into oblivion together. The thought brought something extra to the table, a feeling I couldn't quite call anger. I hurt too much to be mad. Several years had passed since I'd returned from the expedition to the portal planet in hyperspace. At that time, assault troopers had allied with Orange to Micah Lohars against the Kargs. It had been a bloodbath for all concerned. The humans making the ultimate sacrifice, and those of us who'd sacrificed had purchased with our efforts badly needed supplies. These automated factories, space vessels to defend the solar system, and antitoxins to cleanse the bio-terminator. Much had changed since the expedition. Much had remained the same. It had been several years since I fought in combat. My bio-suit might have forgotten what to do. No. I felt it then. The old familiar surge of the symbiotic skin secreting berserker gang into my brain. I remembered how to clamp down on the process. Too much anger made a trooper foolish. The chemical rage in me drove away some of the throbbing pain. The foggy tendrils of unconsciousness retreated. Lying on the decking, I stirred. A stab of agony almost snapped me out of the attempt. More bio-suit secretions added to my determination. I had to do this. I couldn't let... Who was behind the attack? Don't worry about that now. Kill the other tiger before he kills you. I wanted to follow the advice, but my right leg didn't want to work. The hurt. The symbiotic suit hardened around my broken leg. It would help me walk. At the same time, more battle chemicals seeped through my regular skin into my bloodstream. I managed to drag myself up to a seated position. With my chin clicking a lever, I attempted to turn on my helmet radio. It didn't even buzz with static. The thing was dead. Okay, fine. I was on my own. I'd been in these kinds of situations plenty of times. I could still do this. My gun. Where was my gun? I glanced around. Then I saw my forty-four lying on the decking about twenty meters away. A single try to lurch to my feet caused me to sprawl forward onto my chest. Waves of renewed agony made me groan. I must be worse off than I realized. No matter. I had my wits, right? First licking my lips, I began a long, slow crawl toward the magnum. My legs simply refused to respond. Luckily, my arms worked well enough. I dragged myself along the deck plates. At the same time, the scrape of claws told me the Lohar neared my position. My lips twisted with anger. I'd paid for these automated factories with human blood. Too many good men and women had died helping the tigers. For them to turn around now and try to screw us... No way, I whispered. As I reached the bigger corridor, I glanced down it. Ripped bulkheads, torn decking, electric smoke, and blue zapping lights showed me the devastation. What had the Lohar been packing inside his body? Had it been a mini-nuke? A throbbing pain beat in my mind. It seemed to have synchronized with my heart rate. That didn't matter anymore. Reaching the forty-four became my universe. I dragged myself along. Another roar caused me to look up. I saw the Lohar. He had to be three hundred meters down the corridor. How had I heard his claws scrape from that distance? Had I imagined the sounds? 
By concentrating, I saw he wore a green jumpsuit and seemed muscled just like the first one. This one reached up to his breather and tore it away. He roared with defiance. In case you're wondering, the tiger didn't need the mask in order to breathe. Lohars use the same air mix humans do. The breather was likely a precaution against any bio-terminator in the air that might have seeped through the force screen or lingered from construction. That he took it off told me he didn't plan to live much longer. In any case, the Lohar's roar caused the hairs to stand up on the back of my neck. It must have been a primeval thing, a reaction learned long ago by humans during prehistoric times. The tiger began to run with his arms pumping smoothly. Then he began to bound, using super Lohar strength. I had no doubts left. These Lohars possessed bionic enhancements. Putting my head down, I crawled. I heard his thuds, the impacts of his feet striking the decking. They grew in volume. I heard his harsh breathing. Metal groaned in complaint at his weight and velocity. I reached the gun, fully expecting it to have become a pile of twisted junk. No, sir. This was a piece of Earth's finest gunsmith art. I grabbed it, sat up, and gripped the magnum with both hands. The tiger could move, all right. He was less than eighty meters from me. I snapped off a shot so the forty-four bucked in my hands. The kick hurt my right shoulder, but I held on. The slug hammered against his left shoulder, blowing off bits of cloth, bone, and spraying blood. The Lohar also lost his smooth symmetry, twisting. The motion caused him to land wrong on his left foot. It slid out from under him. He collapsed hard onto his chest. That made me grin. The tiger looked up. Across the distance I aimed the forty-four at his face. He squeezed his eyes closed, scrunching his face. What was that about? The Lohar exploded vanishing in the same kind of titanic blast as the first one. Had he panicked, blowing himself too soon? I'd say yes. Because he laid down, the strongest concussion and fireball blew up and down instead of side to side as the first one had done. Even so, the blast sent me tumbling backward. As I rolled, I tucked into a fetal ball. I also gripped the forty-four tight against my chest. It was a good thing I did. As I lay gasping on the deck plates, with my ears ringing, I heard a third roar. How many of these tiger bombers are there? What was the point of the attacks? It seemed as if they wanted to assassinate me more than destroy the automated factory. Had the Lohar industrialists known about the hidden killers? If so, what implication did that have for the last humans in orbit around Earth? After the destruction of 99% of humanity, we'd fought back from extinction. With all our hearts, we tried to walk along the road of recovery. Mankind's unified hope was to take our place beside the many aliens, forcing them to recognize us as equals. Commander Creed, the tiger shouted. As I lay on the decking, I raised my head. Far down the hall strode another tiger in a green one-piece. Attempting to lift the forty-four, I discovered my arm now refused to obey my will. Sweat stung my eyeballs as I strained. My hand worked, but the arm just wasn't going to do its task. Okay, I had to think of something else. Once more, I raised my head. The tiger marched toward me like final doom. He didn't seem to be in any hurry. Would he have to blow himself up, or could he kill me with his hands? Maybe I shouldn't give him a choice. I moved my head to the left, searching but finding nothing I could use to defend myself. Turning my head to the right, however, I saw a possibility. Slowly I wriggled my body to the right and up several meters. Flee, Commander Creed, the Lohar shouted. If you are able. Then he chuckled in the throaty tiger manner. I hated him. I refused to give him the pleasure of dying at his hand, or his blast. Once I'd situated myself, I waited, gripping the magnum. 
My visor had a crack in the HUD, but it was still whole. When the Lohar was twenty meters from me, I raised my head one last time. Who are you? I asked. He smiled, exposing his tiger fangs. Both arms reached out. He let his claws extend. They were titanium-tipped, just as the others had been. I am Shi Feng, Commander Creed, the tiger boasted. I am the purity of the Lohar. My triad had the duty to expunge you from life. No longer will your existence sully our universe. Soon you humans will pass into the twilight. No one will mourn your race. You are a foul, barbaric species. I have a saying for you, Lohar, I told him, using my helmet speakers. Speak your death words, and then I will speak mine, he said. Don't count your chickens before they hatch, I said. He furrowed his tiger brow. What does that mean? My forty-four rested on the floor. I couldn't lift its weight. Aiming the barrel at his left foot, I squeezed the trigger. A single boom was my reward. Several things happened at once. The magnum flew out of my hand, jerking my arm. That hurt. Even so, I rolled to the right into a torn hole in the decking. As my body began to drop, the distance to the bottom looked to be fifty meters down, the slug blew away his foot. The lohar shouted with pain. The shot blew his leg backward, bringing his body down onto the decking. The tiger exploded. I was hoping prematurely. Spinning as I dropped, I managed to stare upward at the gaping rent in the decking. The blast blew over it, doing little harm to me. I grinned. Then I readied myself to hit the ground. I knew the impact would hurt, maybe break more bones. But my biosuit was built to absorb punishing damage. My muscles and hardened bones could also take much more hurt than average. What had the tiger said? This triad had the duty to kill me. Triad meant three. The Shi Feng wanted to exterminate humanity. Okay. That meant... I struck the bottom. It was the last thing I remembered before the impact dashed me into unconsciousness. Chapter Two I broke bones, tore muscles, ripped ligaments and tendons, and ruptured a kidney. In a phrase, I was a physical wreck. Fortunately, we still had special drugs and a Jelk Corporation healing tank. Unfortunately, they weren't on Earth. After my people found me, scraped me off the floor, and set me in a special cradle, they lifted me from Earth and rushed to Mars Base. There they soaked me in the healing liquid. Afterward, I was on bed rest for a week. I suppose an explanation would be in order. The they, in this instance, was the Forerunner Guardians, my people. Maybe I should back up a moment and give you a quick and dirty guide as to how humanity had gotten into this mess in the first place. A little over six years ago, everyone on Earth was blissfully ignorant about the true state of affairs in our region of the Orion Arm, that's the name of our spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, where Earth resides. Before the day, we humans went to work, watched TV, debated politics, religion, fashion, cheered our teams, loved our wives, or husbands, and quarreled over everything. Just before the day, a Rhode Island-sized alien spaceship zipped past Neptune, Jupiter, and Mars to park in Earth orbit. The U.S. sent up a shuttle to greet it. My dad piloted the craft. But when Mad Jack Creed tried to communicate with the alien vessel, it beamed him into oblivion. Afterward, the alien ship launched nuclear-tipped missiles. Moscow, Berlin, Paris, Washington, Los Angeles, Mexico City, Honolulu, Beijing, and other great cities vanished in thermonuclear fireballs. A second wave of alien missiles crisscrossed the planet spraying a deadly bio-terminator everywhere. That was the day. 
On day plus one, a space lander came to Antarctica near our science outpost. Look, I won't bore you with too many details. This is supposed to be a quick and dirty guide, remember? In our region of the Orion Arm, two alien power blocks waged a death struggle against each other. They had been for centuries. The stronger group was the Jelk Corporation, run by small, red, rumple-stiltskin extraterrestrials. They were few in number and were originally from a different space-time continuum. It took me a long time to wrap my head around that idea. Anyway, as energy beings, the Jelk had taken on material forms, given themselves bodies. Supposedly, Jelk lived for profits. They used other aliens to do their dirty work, mostly the lizard-like Saurians. The other side, the Jade League, run by the Lohars, learned that the Jelk Corporation planned to recruit hundreds of millions of Earthers as soldiers. Most Lohars had funny ideas about religion and honor. They figured it would be doing humanity a favor to kill us off nobly rather than let us become Jelk slaves. I'd never accepted such double talk, but that's getting ahead of the story. The Rhode Island-sized warship had been a Lohar Dreadnought-class vessel, a hyperspace craft. The lander in Antarctica belonged to the Jelk Corporation. A Jelk fleet had chased off the Dreadnought. I'd known no such fine distinctions at the time. With my rifle, I'd gone out to do war against the crew and the alien lander. For the sake of brevity, I'll fast-forward the situation. We assault troopers got our start with the Jelk, with shock cloth in particular. After the Earth smoldered in radioactive ruin, he captured us as if he was a big game hunter. Then he injected his chosen ones with steroids, surgically put in the neuron strings, and forced us to fight as corporation slave soldiers. In doing so, we bought the survival of the rest of humanity— who lived in Shaw Cloth's worst freighters, which he landed on the poisoned Earth. At Sigma Draconis, during the middle of a savage space battle against the Lohars, I turned the tables on Shaw Cloth. I hijacked his battle jumper. Unfortunately, I failed to kill the bastard, although I destroyed his body, watching him escape as an energy being. With the battle jumper in my possession, I returned to Earth. There my people fixed the landed freighters. Each lifted off the poisoned planet. I had plans to do whatever I needed to strengthen humanity's odds for survival. Before I got very far with that, the second power block, the Jade League, made its next move with us. As I said earlier, the Purple Tamika Emperor led the Lohar militarists and the League. As a race, they were religious fanatics. They viewed their greatest duty as guarding the Forerunner artifacts scattered throughout the Orion Arm. What's a Forerunner artifact, you ask? Any machine or device constructed by the First Ones. They're long gone, by the way. The other extraterrestrials remember them as legends, almost as gods. One of the ancient Forerunner relics had resided in the Altair star system. It had been huge a gleaming silver donut-shaped object with a circumference of a medium-sized asteroid. In its center had been an artificial black hole. As Jelk owned assault troopers, we tried to capture it. A maze of tightly packed meteors had orbited the artifact, guarded by the Lohar Fifth Legion. Before we could reach the thing, it vanished from sight. Turned out the Forerunner artifact had gone to a portal planet in hyperspace. That had opened a gate into a dreadful space-time continuum. For many millennia, Abaddon and his cargs, trillions of them in a billion spaceships, had been trying to get out of the dying universe and into ours. This was their big chance. They were xenophobic against everyone, desiring to annihilate all non-carg life. Well, after we assault troopers deserted Jelk service, Orange Tamika Lohars showed up in the solar system. They wanted to make a deal for our help. The various colored Tamikas were political factions among the Tigers, just so you know. Now, I bet I can figure out what you're thinking. The Lohars slaughtered all but one percent of humanity. Why help the Tigers at all, right? At the time, I figured to grab whatever could help humanity out of our hole. I couldn't afford to be choosy. 
By loading up assault troopers in the Lohar dreadnoughts, hyperspace vessels, we gained warships of our own as payment, along with automated factories and antitoxins to clean up the Earth. My outlook was simple. Survive first, get revenge second. Besides, if the Kargs reached our universe, neither Lohars, Jelk, nor humans were going to live much longer anyway. As a Lohar allied assault trooper, I finally reached the artifact in the portal planet in hyperspace. There, I convinced the relic to teleport into the solar system's asteroid belt. It appeared near Ceres, the biggest asteroid in the belt. With the artifact's disappearance from the portal planet, the passage from the Karg space-time continuum into ours collapsed, stranding the terrible enemy. That saved our universe from the invaders, although my woman Jennifer remained behind as a captive. In hyperspace, I learned that Forerunner objects were alive, after a fashion. It was one more reason why the various alien races worshipped at them as shrines to the Creator. The Jelk didn't worship, though. They needed the artifacts in order to split into halves, like an amoeba, increasing their population. The ancient artifacts were incredibly important to Orion armed politics and war. Earth now possessed one out in the asteroid belt. After our return from hyperspace, the last assault troopers became Forerunner Guardians. We even received three warships from the Lohars as a gift. They also vacated Mars Base, which the Tigers had built for themselves. I'd become a guardian to an alien shrine parked in the solar system. With the artifact, I was able to bargain from a position of greater strength. We desperately needed that. The reason was simple. Every alien I'd met thought of humans as beasts. If the extraterrestrials were really kind, they just figured we were hopelessly savage barbarians. On that basis, our savagery, our bid to enter the Jade League had been denied. They said we weren't ready to join the civilized races. Thus, we were on our own in a galaxy at war, a pimple outpost with barely the strength to halt space pirates from looting our system. Now, to top it all off, a triad of Shi Feng Lohars, whatever they were, had tried to murder me. They'd hidden out in the Wyoming automated factory for at least a month. Had the industrialists known about them? Had the tramp haulers? I sat in a chair in my room on Mars, pondering the situation. The Lohars under Admiral Saris, a purple Tamika tiger, had built Mars base beside Mons Olympia. That's the tallest volcano in the solar system. Seems the tigers had liked tramping on the mountain in their atmospheric suits. Even after years of vacancy, one could still find their footprints on Mons Olympia. A Lohar flag used to whip about on the pinnacle. My best friend Rollo had torn it down. He'd put the flag in our communal urinal, pissing it out of existence particle by particle. Rollo didn't like the tigers much. The steroid 68 had given him massive muscles. It seemed to have made him angrier, too. Naturally enough, we called it Roid Rage. Mars Base was a dome, as envisioned by NASA. It shouldn't have been that bad. Lohars were quite a bit bigger and taller than the average human, so the quarters should have been spacious for us Earthers. The Japanese used to live in tiny quarters compared to Americans. The Lohars seemed to embrace this tradition as well. While most of the quarters felt like closets, mine afforded me a little elbow room and even sported a viewing port. Outside, red sand swirled across the ground as if Mars was a giant Mojave desert. A starfighter lifted from a pad, hot exhaust sending it screaming up to space. My bones still mended, bonding the brakes. Most of the tendons worked again and the ligaments had regained their elasticity. I wore jeans and a t-shirt, gratis, of an underground warehouse in vanished Denver. My normal 6'3 frame had bulked up six years ago. Ten regular tough guys wouldn't have stood a chance against me. It wasn't only the greater strength, but the speed, timing, and training. My chamber boasted a military cot, a desk, computer screen, shelf of books, and some weightlifting equipment along with a well-stocked bar, complete with tall stools. 
I also had a pool table. Dimitri, Rollo, and I played all the time. We were the starship captains. Each of us commanded a former Lohar cruiser. Dimitri presently patrolled the belt. Rollo orbited Mars beside my waiting starship. The crew was on vacation. A beep now alerted me. I looked up from my chair. A pretty receptionist appeared on the computer screen. Dr. Sant is ready to see you, sir, she said. Send him in, I said. Yes, sir, she said before disappearing. Dr. Sant was an orange to mica lohar. Each tiger belonged to a different color, which indicated his faction. Purple Tamika presently held the throne and most major military commands. Dr. Sant had been one of the few Lohars to survive the portal planet with us, along with several hundred orange Tamika warriors. I'd first come to know them as their alien contact officer. Since our return, Dr. Sant had taken up residence on Ceres. He studied the Forerunner object and devoured Lohar holy texts. As I said, they're religious crusaders. During his last three years in the solar system, Dr. Sant had begun a metamorphosis from a science officer into a religious disciple. His survival on the portal planet had a profound effect on his thinking. I should point out that during his stay on Ceres, Dr. Sant had enlightened me about several facets of Orion Arm politics. I was hoping he could explain the Shi Feng Lohars to me. That's why I'd summoned him from Ceres. I hadn't been sure he'd come. A chime sounded by the door. Pushing up to my feet, I said, Enter. The door slid open to reveal a seven-foot bipedal tiger who stooped at the shoulders. He was thinner than the average Lohar. He had white in his facial fur, and the eyes were a faded yellow. In the old days, he wore a silver and black uniform with orange chevrons. Today he wore an orange garment like an ancient Roman toga. The hand gripping the front fold showed a gaudy, plastic-looking ring a little girl might have bought in a bubblegum dispenser. A bright orange rose showed in what looked like its plastic bubble. Commander Creed, Dr. Sant said in the alien language. It pleases me that you are well. I'm glad you agreed to come to Mars, I said, speaking the tiger tongue. I'd learned it aboard the Indomitable a little over three and a half years ago. I approached Dr. Sant, smelling a hint of cinnamon. Reaching out, I slid my hand against a furry palm, the tiger form of handshake. Sant was one of the few willing to greet me Lohar style. Moving to the bar, we spoke pleasantries about his trip and life in the tunnels of Ceres. I mixed him a Bloody Mary. He loved the drink. I poured myself a dash of whiskey, barely wetting the ice cubes. Since I was still feeling woozy from my injuries, I perched on a bar stool. You seem shaken, Sant said. I'm not sleeping as well as I used to, I told him. But don't worry, it will pass. We sipped our drinks and swapped a few more kind words. Finally, Sant relocated to my most comfortable chair. Adjusting his robes, he sat his long frame down, stretching out his furry feet. As a religious seeker, he had given up the habit of wearing shoes. Carefully setting the Bloody Mary on the armrest, Sant told me, I know something troubling has occurred. It's why I interrupted my studies to make the trip here. Did the Emperor send you a message, perhaps? The way Sant asked that alerted me. Why would he? I asked. Sant squinted. I'd been with Lohars long enough to recognize his sudden discomfort. He thought he shouldn't have said that. Picking up his Bloody Mary, it was his second one, he slurped slowly, as if he was trying to give himself time to think. Is there something brewing against Earth in the Imperial Court? I asked. He gestured at me with his drink. My information is sketchy at best. It's far too soon to be certain. Let us wait out events, as I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. Okay, I said, figuring we had time to come back to that. 
I'm more interested in something else. Oh? he said. Yes. What can you tell me about the Shi Feng? Sans' reaction startled me. The Bloody Mary tumbled from his fingers, splashing the red liquid onto his robe, staining it. He appeared not to notice. The glass bounced onto the floor, rolling loudly. My gaze followed it until it bumped against the computer stand. When I looked up, Sant sat frozen, staring at me with his yellow orbs. His lower jaw slid from side to side. Finally, words came haltingly. You... you should not speak that name. Care to tell me why? I asked. His head twitched, breaking the spell. Blinking several times, he seemed to consider what I'd said. Finally, he stared at me even more intently than before. I do not understand this, he said. How could you have learned of them? Never mind that, I said. Who are they? Sant shoved up to his feet. Taking several long strides, he stood before the viewing panel, staring out at the sands of Mars. On the bar, I rotated my shot glass on its napkin, waiting. Why was this such a touchy topic? I was more curious than ever. Dr. Sant turned, regarding me. They do not exist. They are a legend. Go on. You cannot know about them. Understanding lit his yellow pupils. He nodded. Did the forerunner object speak to you again? Did it tell you about them? No. He sagged back as if I'd punched him against the chest. He sounded winded as he said, No other race has ever learned of the ones you named. You must swear to me, Commander. Never whisper a word of this to anyone. I'm afraid it's too late for that, I said. Sant groaned. On shaky legs, he returned to the soft chair, practically collapsing into it. They're a legend, you say? I asked him. A myth, he said. A wisp from the old times. It is inconceivable that you learned the name. I had the feeling he was lying to me. It was time to up the stakes. Doctor, I know more than that. Some of the she Feng, No, Sant said, leaning forward. Do not speak that name. It is an ill omen to do so. Why? I asked. I cannot say. They work in triads, I said. He sank against the backrest, staring at me in a stricken manner. Instead of killing with claw or gun, I said. Shi Feng explode. Sant's eyes went wide with disbelief. Then a glimmer of horror entered them. He began to breathe more rapidly. The horror deepened and he whispered, No, this cannot be. They came to Earth? Yes, I said. His panting stopped abruptly until his eyelids fluttered. He worked his jaws, but no sounds issued. It seemed to take an effort of will on his part. He finally whispered, When did this happen? A little over a week ago, on Earth, I said. They were waiting for me in the latest automated factory in Wyoming. They waited for you? he asked. No, that's impossible. You would be dead then. I killed the Shi Feng, Doctor. With a cry, Sant lurched to his feet. He wouldn't look at me. He strode for the door. It seemed he might just leave without telling me what I wanted to know. Lock, I said. Inner clicks meant the door locked from the inside. Frantically, Sant pressed the exit button, but the door wouldn't open. I must leave, Sant said, although he didn't turn to say it. We're going to talk first, I said. 
I cannot speak to any they have signaled for death. You're talking to me now, I told him. Sant pressed the button again. When it wouldn't open, he began to hammer on the metal. I waited. The doctor's actions became more frantic. He pummeled the door. Then he stepped back and slammed a shoulder against it. If we'd been on Earth in a regular house, he would have smashed through. The Lohars had built the dome tougher than that, though. Three times Sant hurled himself at the door. Afterward, he panted before it. Maybe he realized there was no smashing through. Finally, he whirled around. Madness swirled in his eyes. You leave me no choice, Sant said in a harsh voice. Reaching into his robe, he withdrew a white handle. His thumb clicked a button. A force blade the length of a knife shimmered into existence. It was pure energy, able to cut just about anything. Instead of sullying myself, Commander, talking to you about the indescribable, I must kill you. Prepare to meet the Great Maker. Chapter 3 I hadn't expected this. It was past time to calm him down. Hey, I shouted. Do you remember that the Forerunner artifact told me its name? You do know that none of the artifacts has ever told that to a Lohar before. Dr. Sant roared. It was loud in the small confines of my chamber. With flapping robes and long limbs, he rushed me, thrusting the force blade like a rapier. Now it's true succeeding bomb blasts a week ago had beaten my body and broken my bones. The healing tank at Mars base had also speeded my recuperation. I wasn't one hundred percent, but I was still an assault trooper. Even in my condition, I was too quick for him to kill me easily. With long flourishes and grunting slashes, Sant came after me. The force blade sliced through the bar top. It chopped a lamp on my nightstand and slashed my blanket to ribbons. I'd grabbed the blanket off the bed and hurled it at Sant like a net. I would have tried to talk sense into him, but he did wield a force blade. They were nasty weapons, perfect for close quarters combat. All he had to do was touch the energy blade against me, and it would cut skin, bones, muscles, and interior organs. That thing was no toy. Who would tire first? Normally it would be Dr. Sant. Today. After three passes around the room, I began to pant. His eyes still glowed with righteous fury. He gripped the front of his robes with his free hand and stood still for a moment. I could see the wheels turning in his mind. I'd been able to dodge his rushes. Maybe he needed a new approach. A hard grin stretched his lips. Slowly, using his greater reach, he began to back me toward a corner. First gulping air, I said, The Forerunner artifact told me its name. That it did so is a sign of my uniqueness. Surely you realize that, Doctor. I'm above your petty rituals and legends. So these Shi Feng hunted me in Wyoming. So what? They failed, exploding uselessly. I'm marking them for death now, not the other way around. You don't want to keep attacking me or you'll face my wrath. Sant halted. He tilted his head to the side, appearing quizzical. I hold the force blade, not you. I'm an assault trooper, though. No! You are a guardian of the object. That's one of my duties, sure, I said. But first and foremost, I'm an assault trooper. That means I can defeat you. Is that why you keep retreating before me? No. It's because I don't want to hurt you, Doctor. You're my friend. Lowering the force blade to his side, he stood hunched over. From glaring at me, his eyes darted away again. He backed up until he could view the panel. Although he faced me, he side-glanced at the sands of Mars outside. I have ridden the artifact, Sant said, almost as if reciting a litany. I survived the deaths of millions against the ancient enemy. I have been chosen for a holy task. I cannot throw away my life. 
I have a duty to Orange to Micah. This is much better, I said. Turn off the force blade and set it down. Let's talk. He frowned. Didn't you hear what I just said? Sure I did. I am chosen. I cannot throw away my life. That means you'd better put down your weapon before I decide I've had enough of this. Sant shook his head. No, it means you are dead. They have marked you to die. By telling me, by naming them, you have brought me into the circle. I cannot stand with you against them. Thus I must end it here before Orange Tamika loses my uniqueness. If I don't kill you, they will learn I heard of their attack in Wyoming. Then they will come and kill me, too. You're making a bad decision, Doctor. With his free hand, he re-gripped the front of his robe. Hunching forward, he began to stalk me again. He held the force blade in front, waving it as if he knew a knife-fighting technique. Maybe he did. This is your last chance, Sant. Goodbye, Commander Creed. He bounded in a tiger rush, thrusting the deadly knife. I'd seen his thighs tense, however. His body language had screamed his intentions. The lanky tiger roared at me as he came. Maybe he thought he could frighten me. No, that was it. I'd had enough already. My mind snapped into overdrive. His movement seemed to slow down. The long arm kept coming as he leaned and stretched his seven-foot frame. He staked all on the thrust. If I'd been a regular human, no doubt the doctor would have skewered me. Instead, I dodged, but I'd forgotten about my bed's exact placement. The side of my leg struck the edge and I toppled. Both of us seemed to move slowly now. Sant still thrust as I fell onto the bed. He straightened. I rolled across the mattress. My leg shot up and I stood on the other side. Sant swiveled his hips, thrusting again. My feet tangled in the blanket lying on the floor. I almost tripped because of it, but I stilled my momentum long enough to keep standing. That took too long, though, giving Sant the needed time. When my attention riveted back to him, the force blade already thrust at my midsection. Sant's length allowed him to reach widthwise across the bed to reach me. Even to my speeded senses, my hands blurred. The edge of the force blade touched my forearm. Blood spurted. A loud crack told of broken wrist bones. His. Tiger fingers became numb and released the handle. Given the safety design of the force blade, the energy portion of the knife disappeared. Time flowed back into normal channels for me then. Because of my move and throw, Sant sailed over me, flailing his long lohar limbs. He crashed against a wall and slid down in a jumbled heap, tangled in his robes. I clamped a hand onto my bleeding forearm. The force blade had barely touched the skin, but it was enough to spill blood. A fraction more pressure and that end of my forearm would be lying on the bed in a welter of gore. Instead, the white handle lay on the bed. As Sant worked to untangle himself, I reached down and picked up the force blade. A hum warned me of the reappearance of the energy blade. I cut the blanket and wrapped part around my forearm. Blood soaked it, but I staunched some of the bleeding. Turning with his force blade in my hand, I faced Sant. He sat against the wall, cradling his broken wrist. I walked to the bar, set down the knife, and picked up my glass. Ice cubes rattled in it. I drank the liquid. It was barely enough to wet my mouth. Even so, that made my cheeks warm. The Shi Feng is a holy order, Sant said from where he sat. They cleanse away evil. None has ever seen one. In their purity they commit deeds no Lohar would dare. They accept modifications to their body. They commit ritual suicide and they use their blood to wipe away wickedness. I'm wicked? I asked. You have learned the name of a forerunner artifact. 
You are the chief guardian to an object that belongs to the Lohars. If you're referring to its stay in the Altair star system... I am, Sans said. Yeah, well, I didn't move the Altair object. It relocated on its own, remember? That is not how the Shi Feng would view it. To them, you are a beast, Commander. It is inconceivable for a creature to do the things you have. No. You must relinquish the Forerunner artifact. You must formally return it to the Lohars. Now you can say their name? I asked. It doesn't matter, he said. With his back against the wall, Sand slid up to his feet. You're about to die. I raised an eyebrow. Why? Are the she Feng about to break into my room? It is not wise to mock what you don't understand. That's why I asked you to come to Mars. Explain the situation to me. You are marked for death, Commander. That you have resisted your fate endangers the rest of us. I cannot allow that to happen. I picked up the force blade. Do you see who has this? I will make your passing quick, Commander. And perhaps it is well for you to understand. He winced painfully, glancing at his broken wrist. Let me summon you aid, I said. No. I will leave on my own. First, you must know this much. When one mentions the Shi Feng, it means their actions must be honorable. Without realizing it, you brought the old codes into play. What are you talking about? I asked. Dr. Sant reached into his robe and pulled out a wicked little needler. He pointed it at me. This is a spring-driven weapon, the doctor said. It holds poisoned slivers. It was fashioned without any ferrous metals. Thus it passed your detectors. If you had that all along, why use a knife to try to stab me? I asked. Didn't you hear my words? You invoked the Shi Feng. I had to slay you with a knife, washing away your insult with blood. What insult? That you, a beast, should name the Holy Ones, he said. Holy Ones blow themselves up to kill others? Goodbye, Commander Creed. Shi Feng, I shouted. Sant frowned. Why do you shout those as your death words? I'm invoking them. You have to fight me honorably now. I attempted that. Now you will use dishonor to question me. I cannot allow myself to be captured and give away Lohar secrets. Instead, I will kill you any way I can. I stared into his eyes. He seemed to mean what he said. Listen, Sant. I said. You don't realize... He pulled the trigger seven times, sending seven poisoned slivers into my stomach. I stared at him, then I collapsed onto my knees. He tucked the needler within his robes, then he shoved his broken wrist there as well. I sucked air into my constricted throat. You shot me? I wheezed. I killed you, Commander Creed. No, I said. Are you daft? Look at you. Don't you realize I still have medical monitors in me? Sant frowned. Maybe he didn't understand. Intense dizziness struck me. The chamber seemed to spin. Then the door slid open and several assault troopers rushed in. Sant managed to redraw the needler in time to shoot the first one. The rest reached him and bore him to the floor. That's when I fell unconscious for the second time in a little over a week. I couldn't believe it. Chapter 4 Sand's poisoned slivers came closer to killing me than the damage I'd taken in Wyoming. I learned this in retrospect after several days with a 105-degree temperature. I regained consciousness in Mars Base Medical hooked to a jelk machine we'd salvaged from the battle jumper. 
This time it took more than the healing tank to save me. Lying there drowsily, I realized I'd gotten too cocky. I should have been ready for something like that. Kept a weapon in my chamber. Sand had surprised me with his force blade and then the needler. Where others go unarmed, there it is wise to go armed. It was an old proverb, one well worth remembering. Sant's attack also hammered home the truth of a surprise attack. The Shi Feng had used tactical surprise as well. Since prehistoric times, it had been a force multiplier, and it would continue to be so in the future. Next time, it needed to be on my side. I ached all over. My eyelids felt gritty every time I blinked. I thought about getting up anyway. Instead, I drifted back to sleep. The next day, I couldn't keep anything down. The fever returned, this time only reaching 103. I drank liquids and spewed them back up onto my hospital gown. A nurse put a green solution into the tube sticking in my arm. I slept more. By now, it seemed as if I'd done it forever. The fever broke and then came back at 106. I had a terrible dream of Abaddon and his cargs. The reality of it startled me. I drifted in the void in a spacesuit. Far away in the distance I saw a stellar snowflake. Stars shined behind it. That didn't make much sense, even in my dream. And I realized that was no snowflake. It was a giant karg vessel. We'd faced far too many just like these in hyperspace. I moved toward the snowflakes, and I realized more were coming. Dread filled me at the thought. The giant karg ships weren't in hyperspace, but regular space. I began counting them, soon reaching fifteen. Then I saw jelk battle jumpers, one hundred of them at least. They moved in a cone formation, with the end point farthest away from the cargs. The open part of the cone faced the giant snowflakes. In front of the cone formation, at a precise distance, was a gauzy substance like a titanic lens. It was most odd. All at once, the Jelk battle jumpers in the cone fired their lasers at the gauzy substance. The rays filled the lens with bubbling light. Suddenly, a gigantic, coherent ray beamed from the other side of the lens. It was then I saw smaller Jelk vessels at the edges of the lens. Did the ships do something to focus the massive beam? I suspected yes. In any case, the giant ray reached out and struck a karg snowflake vessel. The beam disintegrated the alien structure, melting what turned out to be individual karg moth ships attached to the gargantuan mother ship. The Jelk lens ray snapped off. The cone formation battle jumpers had stopped beaming their lasers into their side of the lens. Were they recharging their coil banks? More karg snowflakes moved up. Clinging to them were moth-like ships with glowing nuclear eyes. Those vessels detached from the mother ships. Each craft spewed exhaust as they accelerated toward the Jelk lens. The massed, cone-shaped formation fired into the lens again. As before, a coherent beam lanced out the other side. It struck a moth ship. The giant ray encompassed the entire karg vessel and it annihilated everything so the craft disappeared like a giant blowing out a match. The gargantuan ray moved like a swath, destroying one karg mothership after another. Did I witness a real space battle between the kargs and the jelk, fought in the corporation's core worlds? In my dream, I believed that to be the case. Yet that would imply the kargs, or some of them at least, had escaped from their space-time continuum. The cone formation with its lens wreaked savage destruction against the karg vessels. Finally, however, some moth ships drew close enough to the lens to attack. The eyes on the nearest karg vessels glowed brilliantly. They seemed to bubble as if made of red-hot lava. Then a red ray beamed. It touched the gauzy lens. More karg beams hit it. In a consuming flash, like tissue in a bonfire, the lens vanished, as did the smaller ships at the lens's edges. The cone formation advanced, and the surviving karg moth ships gathered in a square. 
Beams flashed back and forth between the two fleets. Ships exploded, often harming its nearest neighbor. I doubt I'd ever witnessed a deadlier battle. Finally, the last Jelk vessel disappeared under a barrage of red rays. The Kargs had won, but at a dreadful cost. Hulks and pieces of starships floated everywhere. As I watched from a distance, my fevered nightmare became personal. During our invasion of the portal planet, Abaddon had addressed me via screen. He'd shown me how he tortured my sweet Jennifer. For years now, I'd agonized over her fate. Maybe that's what powered the horrible dream. In the nightmare, the feeling of dread grew worse than ever. I watched as Karg motherships cruised through the wreckage of battle. More giant snowflakes appeared, with huge exhausts showing they accelerated, traveling who knew where. I sped toward one of the snowflakes. Believe me, I didn't want to go there. Yet nothing I did could stop my advance. No, I refused. I was Commander Creed. I'd defeated the Kargs before. I wasn't their slave, rushing to them at their bidding. With an intense effort of will, I halted my dream plunge toward that vessel. Then it seemed that I didn't float in space anymore. Instead, I stood on a bridge. I didn't recognize the type of ship. It must have been a newer style. Before me, a Baroque screen sizzled. A fuzzy image appeared on it. I couldn't see the exact features of the thing, but I saw two fiery eyes like the pit of hell burning at me. As I stood on the bridge, the weight of those eyes wilted my resolve. The burning orbs had something to do with Jennifer. Bracing myself, I roared defiance at the eyes. I shook a fist at them. Commander Creed, said the deadliest voice I'd ever heard. The words rumbled against my chest, vibrating with debilitating power. Abaddon, I whispered. The sizzling worsened on the elaborate screen. The image grew fuzzier, but the eyes became like twin fires. I felt the gaze, which locked my jaws. I see you, foolish mortal, Abaddon told me. You are far away, and you are desperate. This is a dream, I managed to whisper. How truly dense you are, Abaddon said. You think yourself so wise concerning science and reality. Yet you understand little of power and supernatural force. You're saying this is real, not a dream? How can you comprehend? Yes, you dream, but I am indeed speaking to your unconscious mind in the manner of my kind. You're a demon, I said. Is that what you're saying? Come closer to me, mortal. Look at me with your soul and lose all hope. I almost listened to him. No, I shouted averting my gaze from the burning eyes. You're not my master. You're an invader in a place you don't belong. Wrong. I have come home. Now I shall devour the living along with the dead. The Jelk Corporation will defeat you. They fight, but lose every battle. Taking down more of your moth ships all the time, I said. These are the core worlds. I expand my operations, gaining factories every week. My strength grows as I induce saurians and creatures you know nothing about into my kingdom. If you can survive long enough, mortal, I will devour your paltry earth. I will take you, though, and force you to serve me for uncounted centuries. You know nothing of despair, although your woman does. She is my slave, mortal. She is my killer, doing my bidding. Oh, how she hates you, Commander. Perhaps I should send her at you like an arrow to rip out your heart. You're a lying fiend from hell, I said. I'm going to kill you, Abaddon. 
Brave words from a creature locked in sleep. I doubt you shall survive your sickness. Goodbye, little creature. Know that everything you've worked to achieve, I will destroy. There is no hope for your space-time continuum. I have arrived, and humanity's end rushes toward completion. My heart felt sick. What had he done to Jennifer? How had Abaddon escaped hyperspace? Just how many cargs had he brought through with him? Creed! A distant voice shouted. Wake up, Creed, you're having a nightmare. I blinked, confused. Abaddon's burning eyes disappeared. I no longer stood on the strange bridge. Neither did I drift in space. It felt as if I zoomed upward toward the light. Can you hear me, Creed? I felt so utterly weary. Even so, I wanted to wake up. I did, to find a red-headed nurse whose name I didn't know standing over me. She told me I'd been raving, shouting incoherently. Was everything okay? I blinked at her, confused. The dream had felt so real. Yet how could Abaddon have spoken to me from hundreds, perhaps a thousand light years away? That made no sense. What I'd seen couldn't be reality. As always, my subconscious must have taken many truths and twisted them into the nightmare. Yet I have to admit, part of me believed I had glimpsed something more. Could I tell anyone about this, though? I decided to wait. Whatever else had happened, the fever had finally broken. The nurse let me suck on a straw as she held a can of vile glop. This time I kept the liquids down. That was a beginning. I vowed never to let anyone shoot poisons into me again. Why had I gotten fancy with Sant? I should have killed the tiger and been done with it before he could use the needler. Debating with myself what I should have done with the Lohar, letting the Abaddon dream dissipate back into my subconscious where it belonged, I fell into a deep sleep. I stayed that way for twenty-three hours. Something had exhausted me beyond normal. It had to be the fever, right? A dream couldn't have done it. Only a fool would believe such a thing. In any case, I woke up twenty-three hours later, scaring the nurse with my red eyes. She called a doctor. He examined them, shining a penlight into the pupils. After he clicked off the light, he patted me on the shoulder and said I was recovering. I shouldn't worry about the redness. It would go away soon. Finally, two days later, minus twenty pounds and feeling permanently lightheaded, I allowed the nurse to help me stand. I shuffled to a chair, collapsing into it and panting. Why are you up? Lifting my chin off my chest, I found Ella Timoshenko in the room with me. A little over six years ago, Ella had been a Russian scientist. I'd first met her in Antarctica the day after the Earth died. Now she was a former assault trooper turned guardian. Despite the steroid 68, Ella was still thin with a pretty face. Actually, she had sunken cheeks just like a porn star I'd seen in my misspent youth. Her dark hair dangled to her cheeks, giving her an elfin quality. There was nothing pixie about her razor-like mind, though. She enjoyed things you could count and weigh, using the scientific approach wherever possible. Hello to you, too, I said. Ella grabbed a stool, setting it near me, studying my face. We thought you might die this time, Creed. I feel like I've been dead, I said. I wondered if I should tell her about my dream. Then I realized our scientist would be the last person to believe it could have been real. Ella smiled, nodded, and turned away. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this. You're still getting better. Are you kidding? I'm sick of being sick. What's the problem? Give me something to think about. Ella regarded me, biting her lower lip. Finally, she said, The Lohars on Ceres keep pestering us about Dr. Sant. Oh? They want him back. That didn't seem right. 
The Lohars on Ceres were orange to mica warriors. They'd been with us on the portal planet. Out of ten million tigers making the attack, they were the handful who had survived. What's more, they lived because of us. They owed the assault troopers everything. I had the impression they had dedicated themselves to the Forerunner artifact, and to helping mankind survive as a species. I don't understand, I said. They want Sand even after he tried to kill me? Ella smiled tightly, looking as if she had a secret. They have no idea what occurred in your chamber. You'd better explain that. The woman's lips thinned as she stared into my eyes. You have to understand something first. The doctors didn't think you'd make it through this time. You'd just been in the healing tank. A second immersion this soon. Go on, I said. We thought you were dying, Commander. You can understand our grief and rage. Sure. What did you do to Sant? Ella bit her lower lip again. Rollo and Dimitri agreed with me. They said I should proceed with the experiment. Only N7 demurred. What about Diana and Murad Bey? I asked. They were the principal Earth Council leaders. The Council governed the people in the space freighters, the bulk of humanity, in other words. As Forerunner Guardians, we are outside the Earth Council's jurisdiction. It was something I'd hammered home to the others many times. Even so, I tried to coordinate with Diana. There weren't enough of us left to allow squabbles. Ella shook her head. We didn't tell Diana or anyone else on the Earth Council. Rollo and Dimitri agreed with me that we should keep the experiment among ourselves. Enough, I said, panting. I couldn't believe how weak I'd become. Just tell me what you did. You know my area of expertise, Commander. I nodded slowly. During the assault on the portal planet, we'd gained a tiny forerunner artifact the size of a person's fist. In fact, we stole it from the orange to Mica Lohars on the dreadnought Indomitable. That's another of those long stories. In any case, the artifact, called E.P., had beamed a pink ray at Ella. It had fiddled with her mind somehow. Later, E.P. had helped me move the larger forerunner relic presently near Ceres. The small object had remained in the larger one. We hadn't seen E.P. for years now. What had the pink ray done to Ella's mind? We all wondered that, she more than any of us. That became her devoted area of expertise. She commandeered every piece of alien equipment that had to do with the mind and thought control. Using the various devices, the primary tool a jelk machine from our hijacked battle jumper, our Russian scientist had begun experimenting. After two years, Ella had declared herself free of any alien entanglements in her thoughts. I hadn't been so sure, and I'd made the mistake of saying so. After that, Ella went into overdrive. Unbelievably, she found several hidden commands in her mind. Using her alien machines, she deprogrammed herself. Now, I should tell you that I'm skipping tons of technical jargon. I'm not a scientist, though. I'm a fighter. During her experiments, Ella reached dead ends. She also had two seizures and raved like a lunatic for a month. At that point, I'd had enough. I locked her in a cell for further study. Three of her assistants broke Ella out of confinement and took her back to the worst machine, the Jelk device. There, they pushed the limit of their knowledge, using Ella's notes to try one last test. It proved to be the breakthrough. The next day, Ella had greeted me as her lovable self. She went into exquisite detail about what had happened. Her fingers kept tapping her reader showing me brain charts, as if I'd known what any of that meant. Believe me, I'd still had my doubts about her. Ella Timoshenko hadn't. She continued working with the machines in the basement of Mars Base. After that, though, the thrust of her experiments changed. She no longer worried about possessing a traitorous mind. Now she wondered how to read, break, and recondition alien minds. Ella's ordeals had given her a thirst to mess with the aliens who had messed with her. 
Orange Tamika Lohars happened to be in the solar system, but those tigers were our closest allies. Purple Tamika Lohars regularly came to Earth to deliver automated factories. A few of those tigers had disappeared here and there. They found themselves in Ella's chambers with the brain machines. Before you judge us too harshly, listen to our reasoning. The Lohars had come to Earth, slaughtering 99% of humanity. The last 1% barely hung on. We tried to join the Jade League and gain greater protection. The Purple Tamika Emperor had vetoed our entry. Okay. We were on our own, right? As the weakest group around, we relied on our wits and complete ruthlessness. If that meant kidnapping an alien or two to work on, we did it. That doesn't mean I was proud of the deeds. I simply recognized the crisis and acted accordingly. Ella experimented on Purple Tamika Tigers. Several had died. Two became raging lunatics, and one remained a comatose vegetable. I knew her area of expertise, all right. It was one of our darkest secrets. As I sat in my chair in the medical chamber on Mars base, I said, You're not telling me you put Dr. Sant under one of your machines? I am, Commander, Ella said. Why? At first, Ella said, we wanted to know what happened in your quarters. It was obvious you'd used the force blade against him, but where had you gotten the weapon? The knife belonged to Dr. Sant, I said. I know that now. Ella said, her lips stretched in one of the evilest smiles I'd ever seen. Seeing the smile tired me out. I sagged against my chair. Are you all right, Commander? Ella asked. Give me a minute. My eyes closed of their own accord. I don't remember falling asleep or anyone picking me up. When my eyes opened again, I was back in my quarters. My blanket, a new one, was pulled up to my chin. I let my eyes rove around. The room looked as good as new. The viewing panel showed the same red sands and their mindless swirling patterns. Hello, Commander. I turned my head in the other direction, spying the nurse, the pretty redhead. She smiled, stood, and checked on me. After fussing for a while, she retreated, leaving the chamber. When the door opened a second time, Ella walked in with a tray of eggs, ham, toast, and orange juice. My stomach growled as I sat up. I felt ravenous. My hand shook as I picked up the fork. A second later, I forgot about that as I tasted the scrambled eggs. They were delicious. Ella sat on a bar stool, waiting. After I wiped my lips with a napkin, she put the empty tray on the bar. I burped feeling full, rested, and alert. Maybe I could finally start regaining my strength and putting back on the weight I'd lost. Do you remember our last conversation? Ella asked me. It took me a moment of recollection. Yeah, you were about to tell me the worst. What happened to Dr. Sant? Why didn't you tell the Lohars on series about his murderous rampage? I had another breakthrough with the machines, Ella said with the excitement shining in her eyes. Meaning what? I asked. Dr. Sant told me everything that happened in here. It took me several seconds to catch on. You're kidding. He gave you a recap? He gave me much more than that, Creed. I know about the Shifeng. I know why Sant reacted as he did. I also learned some Orange Tamika secrets. You tore those from his mind? I asked. I did, she said. Dr. Sant had been a good friend once, maybe the only true one we had among the tigers. Why had he gone crazy? I imagine after his ordeal with the mind machine that he raved madly or lay catatonic on a bed, staring up at the ceiling. Is Sant still alive? I asked. Oh, yes, Commander, Ella said. He's quite alive. I whipped off the bed cover, stared a second, and yanked the blanket back over my nakedness. Where are my clothes? I asked. Forget about them, Ella said. Do you want to hear what I've discovered? I realized I did. 
Who are the Shi Feng? I asked. A death cult of assassins, Ella said. According to Dr. Sant, their origins belong to the pre-Lohar space age. They're also pre-creator, as in the present tiger religion. Once, the followers of Shi Feng worshipped anthropometric Lohar-like gods and goddesses, much like the Greek pantheon. When the tigers became creator worshippers, the death cult changed with the times. Why do they blow up? I asked. As I said, they're a death cult. They believe in purity and right thinking. The Shi Feng are convinced that only Lohars were made in the image of the Creator. Their fascination with the Forerunner artifacts is intense. Put the two together and it is clear why they had to kill you. I thought about that. Why did they wait so long to make their first strike, then? I asked. As to that, Ella said, I don't know. It is a good question. When you tell me all this about the Shi Feng, what you really mean is that these are Dr. Sant's views about them, right? That is correct, Ella said. I'm not faulting you, I said. I'm merely saying we don't know everything about the Shi Feng, just Sant's coloring of them. Yes, it's good to remember that. So why did Dr. Sant attack me? I believe he told you during your confrontation. Ella said. Among the Lohars, the Shi Feng are held in religious awe. They have an amazing mystique. Legend holds they never fail. So... Dr. Sant believes the Shi Feng wield supernatural powers. You told him about their attack against you. Once he realized you spoke the truth, he believed that he had to kill you immediately. If he didn't, the Shi Feng would come after him. On all accounts, he couldn't allow that. You mean he had to stay alive at all costs? I said. I doubt you realize why, Ella said. Of course I do, for self-preservation. You're both right and wrong, she said. That doesn't make sense, I said crossly. Then bear with me as I explain. Dr. Sant believes he must stay alive at all costs. You're wrong in thinking it's purely because he loves life. In his mind, he must live in order to preach his new message to the others of Orange Tamaika. What message? I asked. Ella slid off her stool and went behind the bar. There she mixed herself a dry martini, setting the glass on the counter. Would you like a bottle of water? She asked. Give me a beer, I said. You're not supposed to have any alcohol yet, she said, sipping from her martini. Ah, that's good. She sipped once more, taking the olive and popping it into her mouth. As she chewed, she regarded me. You've told me about Sans' metamorphosis from scientist to religious seeker more than once, Ella said. I know you've told me about him in order to tease me with the idea that maybe I could get religion too. Ella finished off the martini. She looked pretty doing it. Then she set the glass on the bar. I never want to become like Dr. Sant. Once he viewed reality through a common-sense lens. Now he's a mystic. That he survived the transfer from the portal planet to the solar system has taken on religious significance for him. He can't accept that it simply happened. He has to believe it happened for a reason. Naturally, what we're seeing is the guilt of his survival. He wants to subscribe greater significance to the event than it warrants. Why would he live instead of the others? He can't accept the luck of the draw. Okay, I said. In his search for reasons, Ella said, he pours over ancient Lohar holy books. He studies the artifact. He ponders his existence. Sant told you all this while he was under your machine? I asked. Ella nodded. And? I asked. He yearns to preach a crusade against Purple Tamaika. He believes the Emperor acted without honor in sending Princess Ni to Indomitable. The Emperor's daughter-wife that I shot, I said. Sant sees that moment as an act of the Creator. If you hadn't shot the Purple Tamaika Princess, she would have turned the Dreadnoughts back into normal space. We never would have closed the Portal Planet. The Kargs would be destroying all life in our universe now. In Sant's mind, that was the first strike against Purple Tamaika. 
Since Orange Tamika closed the gate between the space-time continuums, they should hold the throne. Doesn't seem so far-fetched to me, I said. I agree, Ella said. The only part that's odd is his need to put a religious coloring to his desire. I pursed my lips, nodding after a time. I could see her point. And that is why Dr. Sant had to kill you. He has a holy message to bring to Orange Tamika, or so he believes. If the Shi Feng slew him, that righteous cause would die with him. Okay, I'm following you so far, I said. But how does Sand figure Orange Tamika has a chance of taking over from Purple Tamika? The Orange lost too much strength in the destruction of the three dreadnoughts. That's the strange part, Ella said. I wanted to keep Sand under the machine and learn more. The protestations of his warriors on Ceres meant I didn't have the time. What are you talking about now? I asked. I wanted your opinion about what to do next. It's why I spoke to you a few days ago. When you passed out again, I had to make the decision on my own. Back up a bit, I said. What's the strange part first? It concerns the Jelk Corporation, she said. We know there's been less combat between the Corporation and the Jade League these past six years. Sans heard rumors as to a possible reason why. This I want to hear. Several major Saurian fleets appear to have left the frontier, Ella said. The frontier was between the Jelk Corporation and the Jade League. For centuries, the two sides had warred. The majority of the attacks came from the Jelk against the Jade League. Saurians crewed most Corporation war fleets. Does Sant know where the Corporation fleets went? I asked, recalling my dream. The Jelk had battled in the Core Worlds, wherever those were. He does not, Ella said. And that troubles him. It appears to trouble many in the Jade League. Unrest between allies has risen. Jade League allies? I asked. Ella nodded. Okay, I understand that part. What's this decision you had to make? I let Dr. Sant go, Ella said. You did what? He's back on Sirius among his warriors. That's crazy, Ella. The tiger shot me. He tried to kill me. Now the Orange Warriors will take up arms against us. We can't afford that. You must relax, Commander, she scowled. Frankly, your words are insulting. Do you think I'm an idiot? Of course not, I said. Surely you understand that I used the machine on him, Ella said. I erased his memories of my questioning. I erased his memory of shooting you. Naturally, I also blotted out mention of the Shi Feng. The machine can do that? On Lohars, Ella said. Not on humans, though. Sure, I said. That's okay, then, I guess. Do you really trust the machine that much? He could end up remembering. I'm not sure it was worth the risk. Don't we want him to spread unrest among the tigers? That's a good question, I said. There is something else, she said. I added something more to Dr. Sant. He's more disposed toward us now. He'll go out of his way to help us any way he can. I sat in my bed, envisioning Dr. Sant pumping those seven shots into me with a needler. I hope you're right about the Jelk machine, I said. They're a tricky race, Ella. Who knows what you really did to Sant's mind? I've been experimenting with the machine for years, she said. You shouldn't worry so much. I know what I'm doing. Talk about your famous last words. From what you've learned, do you think the Shi Feng will attack me again? I do. Great, I said. Well, we're going to have to think of ways of catching them before they do it. This time, I don't want to give them the element of surprise. This time, we're going to get it over them. Chapter 5 the days merged into weeks. The lingering after-effects of Dr. Sand's poisons refused to let me go. I stayed in Mars Base for over two months, slowly recuperating. In that time, I only gained five pounds. 
In the third month, we received another automated factory. If the industrialist captain of the freighter flotilla was surprised to see me, she didn't show it. This factory went to Australia, near Melbourne. It took 507 shuttle flights to bring everything down. After the freighters left, a team of guardians under Rollo searched the premises for a week. They found nothing. Five months after Sant shot me, I returned to duty aboard the Aristotle. The old Lohar cruiser ran smoothly. I took it out to the asteroid belt, paying a visit to Dr. Sant on Ceres. We spoke face to face in the Lohar reception center. He wore his orange toga. I kept to a regulation uniform. Sand shifted across the floor. Hot wind blew through the vents. Sun lamps blazed down on us. This was a vaulted room with a high ceiling. Dr. Sand looked thinner than I remembered. His shoulders stooped more. I gazed into his eyes. Something haunted them. When I stepped close, I no longer smelled the familiar cinnamon odor. I couldn't figure out why. How do you feel, doctor? Really? I asked. He raised a long arm and flicked his fingers. I dream more than usual. He glanced down at me. You're in many of them. Oh? I am ashamed, Commander. In my dreams I shoot you with my needler. I cannot decipher the meaning. I believe your life may be in danger. Not from my hands, he added hastily. I debated saying the name Shi Feng to see his reaction. I had a good idea what that reaction would be. Instead, I said, thanks for the warning. You must not dismiss it so easily, Sant said. I recognize your ways, Commander. You are too trusting of others. He stooped lower as his voice dropped an octave. Events stir on the border. Jade League members recall old feuds. There is a time of troubles approaching. As I stood there with him, I didn't detect any duplicity in Sant. I found myself marveling at Ella's skill with the Jelk mind machine. Are you well? Sant asked later as I made ready to leave. Yes, fine, I said. Why do you ask? You seem tense. I hope it isn't anything I've said or done. Don't worry, Doctor. I've had things on my mind lately. Yes, he said. Don't we all? An hour later, I headed for my ship, little knowing that nothing was going to be the same again. Three days later, I sipped black coffee on the bridge of the Aristotle. The crew sat on tall seats so they could reach their control panels. The ship had been built to tiger scale, but it was ours now. I sat in the center with the other consoles facing inward toward me. That way the personnel could see exactly what I did or said at all times. It was the Lohar method, not ours, but we had to live with it. Before me on the bulkhead was the main viewing screen. From the outside, our cruiser looked like a wedge-shaped slice of pie. The bridge was inside the back third area, buried under many decks and protected by the outer armor. The vessel was fast, boasting a heavy electromagnetic shield in front and a weaker one in back. Tigers didn't believe in running away. For main armaments, we had medium-strength laser cannons. This was a shoot-and-scoot vessel, not a big toe-to-toe -to -toe fighter like the battle jumper we'd once stolen from Shaw Cloth. On the view screen in space gleamed the giant, donut-shaped forerunner artifact that we guardians supposedly protected. I took another sip, savoring my coffee. Commander, Ella said from her station, the beacon near Neptune is reporting. Yes, I said. Ella studied her board before her head snapped back up. I'm detecting starships. Over twenty of them so far. More are coming through the jump gate every minute. I put the cup into its holder, sitting up. Put it on the main screen, I said. I had to work to keep the bite out of my voice. Twenty starships. I didn't like the sound of that. The next automated factory wasn't due for another three months. 
Ella complied, and I found myself looking at shark-shaped vessels of varying dimensions. The gate shimmered yellow. Blue Neptune hung up at the corner about 50,000 kilometers from the gate. The yellow intensified as another great white-shaped vessel slid through. According to the scale symbol on the edge of the screen, some of the ships were bigger than several city blocks. The big ones looked to be larger than Manhattan Island. Those must be Starkians, I said. I agree, Ella said. We'd had our share of run-ins with the Starkians. In size, shape, and disposition, they were baboon-like aliens. They were private contractors without any planetary abode to call home. They roved the star lanes, practicing piracy wherever they could get away with it. As a rule, the other races sneered at the Starkians, driving them away as squatters. We didn't have the hardware to sneer. I wondered what they were doing in the solar system. I count thirty vessels now, Ella said. The shark-shaped vessels kept pouring through the yellow jump gate. That was the main way the aliens moved between star systems. Long ago, the first ones had laid down jump lanes. How they did this, no one knew. The stellar maze was like a giant connect-the-dots puzzle with various lanes linking different star systems. Some believed the forerunners had used the artifacts to make the routes. Make it forty-five ships now, Ella said. Have they tried to hail us yet? I asked. Ella shook her head. Neptune was light hours away from us, making two-way talking difficult. We'd get a message hours after a Starkian had sent it. Then we'd send hours after a similar delay. That made distance arguments difficult. Still, as a matter of courtesy, the Starkian in charge over there could have informed us of his presence. That he didn't hail us implied hostile intentions. I'm counting sixty Starkian warships, Ella said. This was starting to look bad. Is there any sign of Jell Corsarians among them? I asked. Negative, Commander, Ella said. I drained the rest of my coffee, tossing the cup to an ensign. After a time, I drummed my fingers on the armrest of my chair. Eighty vessels, Ella said. They're all Starkian so far, sir. Yeah. I said. It's time to talk to Diana. Ella frowned. Earth Council warships aren't going to make any difference against these many Starkians, sir. More is better, I said. Put me through to Diana. Yes, Commander, Ella said, tapping her board. The Lohars had some nifty tech. One of their coolest was T-missiles. The T stood for teleport. The concept was simple enough. The missile popped out of existence and reappeared hundreds of millions of kilometers closer to the target. It did this in the proverbial blink of an eye. We'd used a T-missile in the Sigma Draconis system to attack Shah Cloth's battle jumper. Six and a half years ago, Lohars had tried to use a similar trick against us in the solar system. I'd been ready for it, though, and had exploded nuclear warheads in the reappearing zone killing the elite Lohar legionaries that had ejected from the T-missiles against us. The Lohars had also perfected a communication system that implemented the teleporting principle. It allowed fast two-way communication without the hours of time lag that speed of light talk would have taken between the Starkians and me. Diana is ready to speak with you, Commander, Ella said. Put her on the main screen. A moment later, Diana appeared. In the past, I had referred to her as the Amazon Queen. She was a tall woman with wide hips, large breasts, and handsome features. She had thick, dark hair and usually oozed cunning and sexual power. She ran the Earth Council together with Murad Bey. For six and a half years, Diana had remained in control. During that time, she had solidified her position among the freighter-living humans— more than once she tried to persuade me to put the Forerunner Guardians under her jurisdiction, using a variety of power plays. The lady simply didn't know how to quit trying to amass more authority. This would be a good moment to remind you that the last one percent of humanity was the troublemaking kind. The hard cases, the gamblers, the lucky and tough-as-nail survivors. That made the Earth Council members the creme de la creme of dangerous. Commander Creed. 
Diana said on the screen. This is a pleasant surprise. It's been too long. She unbound her luxurious hair, running a brush through the strands. It looked as if she took the call from her bedroom aboard her cruiser, a small room with silks and lace hanging everywhere. You're in Earth orbit? I asked. Of course, she said. A Starkian armada is coming through the Neptune jump gate, I told her. Diana set down her brush, giving me a thoughtful study. How many warships have you detected so far? I glanced at Ella. One hundred and thirty, Ella told me. I repeated the number to Diana. The Earth Council leader whistled. It's time for a show of strength, I told her. Meaning you want the Earth fleet to join you at Ceres? Diana asked. I do, I said. Diana glanced elsewhere as if thinking. Idly, she resumed brushing her hair with long strokes. No, she said finally, setting down the brush for the second time. One hundred and thirty is too many alien ships for us to defeat. They're going to have more than that, I said. So I want you to bring your warships and every freighter we have. We're going to show them our solidarity. Diana didn't feign her surprise this time. It was real. Are you crazy? You want to put the last humans in harm's way? No, I said evenly. I want to keep the Starkians from destroying us. Her brow furrowed. You think they're here as slavers? Diana asked. Possibly. Commander, Ella said, interrupting our conversation. I think you're wrong about that. There's only one reason why the Starkians could have come to the solar system. Just a minute, I told Diana. Clicking a switch on my armrest, I muted the Amazon Queen. Then I turned to Ella, raising an eyebrow. They're here for the Forerunner object, she said. From what we know, the other artifacts are heavily guarded. Surely the Starkians think we're too weak to hold on to ours. We've always known this day would come, just not that it would be Starkians. Why have they chosen this time to make their attempt? I asked. Remember what we learned about the Saurian fleets? Ella asked. A few Saurian fleets pulled back, you said. Ella Timoshenko glanced at her board. I saw her lips moving. Soon she said, I count two hundred and ten Starkian vessels. The last two are off the scale for Starkian ships. I suspect those are base ships, Commander. They must hold the young and serve as storage craft and repair yards for the other vessels. That made sense. The Starkian fleets were nomadic. As usual, Ella had cut to the heart of the matter. They're beginning acceleration, Ella said as she stared at her board. Since this information is over several hours old, they've been moving for some time already. By their heading, they appear to be aimed at our artifact. I muttered under my breath. This was just what we needed. First Shi Fang, now Starkians. With a click, I reopened channels with Diana. The Starkians have over two hundred vessels and are headed for the Forerunner object. I need your warships here pronto. We can't defeat that many enemy ships. Diana protested. I'm not asking you to do that, I told her. What then? She asked. If it comes to battle, you're going to cover my ship as I attack the artifact. Diana stared at me in horror. You plan to destroy it? If I have to, I said. How does that help us, Creed? The Amazon Queen asked. If the Starkians have come for the artifact, once you've destroyed it, they'll kill all of us in retaliation. Is that how you play poker? I asked. Diana stared into my eyes. I hope you know what you're doing, Creed. I grinned to mask the fact that I didn't. The one thing I'd learned in life was to show a brave front. I needed Diana, so she had to believe I had a workable plan. Yeah, a workable plan. Over two hundred Starkian vessels against our paltry ten starships and accompanying star fighters. I was going to have to pull the biggest bluff of my life. If I failed, the human race would likely perish within the next few days. Chapter 6 
Thirty-six hours later, my three starships drifted between the Forerunner artifact and the asteroid of Ceres. The cruisers and missile ships of the Earth fleet had already begun deceleration from their race here from Earth orbit. Diana had hedged her bet. The freighters holding the last one percent of humanity hid behind Terra. The three hundred fighter bombers had also remained there. That gave me exactly ten starships to face down two hundred and fifteen alien vessels, along with one thousand seventeen Starkian fighter craft. We can't win this battle, Diana told me via screen. I know Starkians, I said. I'd had personal dealings with them on more than one occasion. They thought of humans as beasts. They were also excitable and sought easy advantages, a good piratical combination. In a sense, they were the scavengers of the space lanes. Did they think of our artifact as easy pickings? I considered that likely. That meant they planned to swoop down and take it. I had my reasons for stopping that at any cost. A few million humans among the vast hordes of interstellar space... We needed every advantage we could cobble together. As I've said, originally the Jelk Corporation planned to use us as slave soldiers. Starkians could just as likely attempt to make us zoo slaves for others. Maybe a few extraterrestrials would even enjoy feasting on us as delicacies. So far we had one clear ability compared to the rest of the aliens. We assault troopers could outfight any other alien as infantry. The Jelk, the Lohars, and the Kargs had all learned the hard way what that meant. With a forerunner object in our solar system, we now had claim to religious importance. If we lost the artifact, we would lose the protection the aura of having a relic granted us. That meant our survival and freedom demanded we keep the object. I left the bridge for some shut-eye. Stretched out on my bed, I fell into a fitful slumber. A dream coalesced soon enough. I was in the Forerunner artifact again with N7, a former mining android. A badden spoke to me via screen, showing me Jennifer hanging by her wrists, her toes an inch above the floor. He offered me a position in his evil hierarchy, telling me he'd give me Jennifer to boot. In my dream, I shouted, asking for Jennifer's forgiveness. She understood I had to do this, right? Creed, she screamed. Save me, I'm your woman. You can't sacrifice me. You're my man, you're supposed to protect me. Jennifer, I whispered. You have to understand. No, she howled as Cargs applied torture devices to her flesh. Creed, help me. My eyes flew open. I lay on my bed in the Aristotle. Sweat soaked my blanket and sheets. I got up drank water, ate a sandwich, and donned my uniform. What else could I have done back there on the portal planet in hyperspace six and a half years ago? If I'd agreed to Abaddon's deal, our universe would have faced a billion enemy starships and a trillion death-dealing cargs. I'd done the right thing. Yet, if that was true, why did I feel like such a heel? The intercom in my room buzzed. Wearily, I went to it. Yeah? I asked. The Starkians are almost here, Ella said. Their chief wants to speak to you. I'm on my way, I said. Back on the bridge, I found myself staring at the Starkian commander, Baba Gobo. As N7 had once told me, Baba would be his name and Gobo was his rank. It meant Lord of Ships. A regular Starkian was the size of a baboon and looked as furry and as ugly. Baba had two long canines at the end of his wrinkled muzzle, each of them a dirty yellow color. He must have weighed ninety pounds, sporting a big pouch with an obscene belly button, easily the heaviest Starkian I'd ever seen. He had a mane like a lion, although his was stark white. I knew it meant he was old, older than Naga Gobo, a Starkian I'd killed in the solar system many years ago. I wondered if this Gobo had known Naga. Just as Naga had, Baba Gobo sat on a dais with raised controls around him. I knew the place stank, because Starkians did. When I'd met them in person before on a beam ship, the chamber had smelled like a filthy zoo cage. 
Baba Gobo lacked clothes. Instead, he wore a harness around his body. He was devoid of weapons or tools, having scarlet streamers instead. The Starkian on the main screen opened his baboon's snout. I would speak to him known as Creed Beast, Baba said. I doubted he knew English. We used translator devices to communicate. Ella touched a switch, splitting the screen into two parts. One half showed the breaking armada. Long tails of fusion thrust showed they applied energy. The shark-shaped vessels had crossed our star system in a hurry and now slowed down for a meeting. They also spewed out masses of starfighters who swarmed the bigger ships like fleas. The Starkians came in a crescent formation, just as the Spanish Armada had come against the English in 1588. I had ten old Lohar cruisers and missile ships to face the Starkians. Most of my vessels were bigger than theirs were. Their largest, however, dwarfed mine. Ella informed me that in tonnage the enemy beat us eighteen to one. I wasn't going to win a Jutland battle or a Midway victory today. Bluff was my only hope, unless I could think of something better fast. Pushing myself off my chair, I strode toward the screen. I'd chosen blue naval uniforms for the Guardians. It gave us a sharper image and a link to extinct Earth fleets. Glowering at the Starkian, I said, Are you the Baba creature? The Starkian stiffened. How dare you insult me? Do you have any understanding of my exalted rank? Lord of all smells, I asked. Is that an insult? Will you look at this, I said. You're too stupid to understand that I am indeed demeaning you before your face. You are the Lord of Starkians after all. He opened his snout, revealing his dental work. I could only imagine the fogging he'd give anyone near enough to smell his breath. For a moment, I expected him to howl with simian rage. Instead, Baba Gobo regained his self-control, closing his snout without uttering a hoot. I re-examined his white mane. With age came wisdom. Perhaps the saying was as true for Starkians as it was for humans. You do not appreciate me naming you as a beast. Do you? he said. I'm a man, I said. The Starkian nodded. There appeared a depth to his dark eyes then. I fixated on that, and a chill worked down my back. Baba Gobo was intelligent. Worse, he had cunning. Combined with self-control, that was a dangerous mixture. Why do your ships block my passage to the Sol object? he asked. Once the artifact had been known as the Altair object. At the time, the Lohar Fifth Legion had guarded it, along with a greater number of starships than I possessed. We are the object's guardians, I said. Ah, he said, before making barking sounds. I recognized it as Starkian laughter. I choose who can and cannot approach the relic, I told him. What gives a beast the right? he asked. I stared at him. He made a complex gesture with his left hand. Let me rephrase my question. What gives you the right? Surely not your puny number of warships. The artifact once rested in a portal planet, I said. The planet was in fact a forerunner machine which the object powered. That opened the way to the Karg universe. Abaddon would have crossed to our space-time continuum and hunted down all non-Karg life, eliminating it. I stopped that by talking to the relic. Among other things, the object told me its name. Baba Gobo's eyes shined wetly, greedily. He leaned toward me. I have heard this story. It cannot be true, though. One such as you cannot possibly know the name well enough to repeat it. I smiled. Is this the extent of your guile? How you attempt to trick me into revealing the ancient name to you? Hooting sounds came out of the background behind Baba Gobo. 
The Starkian commander whirled around. He beat his chest and screeched. He's excitable after all, Rollo said to my left. I turned around. Rollo was my best friend. Of all the guardians, he most resembled a gorilla with his thick neck, massive shoulders, and muscles. The man had the bluest eyes I'd ever seen. I wondered why he was here instead of commanding his starship, the Thomas Aquinas. Before I could ask him, Baba Gobo cleared his throat to my back. I faced the view screen. I have grown weary of your vanity, the Starkian told me. It is time for us to reach an understanding. Several years ago, you slew my great-nephew, Naga Gobo. He dealt with the Jelk, which was an evil deed. I deplore his memory because of that. Yet he was kin to me, and he ruled a Starkian flotilla. You must pay the blood debt of his death. Pray tell me, I said. What does that debt happen to be? I'm sure you already know, Baba Gobo told me. I demand the Sol object. No, I said. I don't think so. Do not play the fool, human. I have overwhelming numbers at my command. If you resist, I will not only destroy your ten warships, but I will hunt down your freighters as well. Oh, yes. I am quite aware of them hiding behind your poisoned earth. I will capture or destroy each craft, eliminating your kind forever. That will atone for your vile deed of slaying Nagagobo and his people. I saved our universe from destruction, I said. You owe me your life. That should atone for your great-nephew's death. Words, Baba Gobo said. They do not impress me. Everyone's an ingrate, I said. Do you realize I lost one hundred thousand troopers saving your ugly hide? The Starkian made another gesture. I took it as a shrug. You leave me no choice, I'm afraid, I said. I am the Forerunner Guardian. You cannot have the object, nor can I allow you to annihilate the last humans. He smirked. There is nothing you can do to stop me. You're wrong, I said. There is the Samson Protocol. He paused a half-beat before saying, I have no idea what that's supposed to be. Samson was an ancient Earth hero, I said. At the time, he was the strongest warrior in the world. His story is told in our holy text. I was not aware you beasts had a holy book. Oh, yes, I said. We most certainly do. In the book of Judges, we are told that the Philistines plagued Samson's people. He killed many of their soldiers and mighty men. Yet he had a weakness. Samson loved beautiful women. This is a common failing among champions, Baba Gobo said. Maybe that was another universal principle. In the end, I said, a woman named Delilah wanted to know the secret to Samson's supernatural strength. She nagged him mercilessly, asking him day and night for the answer. He played along, giving her nonsense answers. Each time, Delilah would perform the needed deed to steal his strength. Then when he slept, she would say, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He'd wake up and kill them. At last, though, Delilah wept bitterly, telling him he didn't love her. If he did love her, he'd tell her his secret. What did your Samson do? Baba Gobo asked. Like the fool he'd become, he told her the secret. Samson had never cut his hair. It was his symbol as a Nazarene, one who had been set aside to the Creator. As he slept, Delilah shaved his head. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke up and attempted to defeat them as he always had, but the spirit of the Creator had left him. Samson had become as weak as other men. The Philistines bound him and burned out his eyes. Then they set him to work as a slave, grinding grain. 
Baba Gobo bristled. Is this what you think you'll do to me? Burn out my eyes? Not at all, I said. Then I do not understand your Samson protocol. That's because you don't know the end of the story. Oh, the Starkian said. By all means, finish it. I'll say this for the baboons. They like a good story as much as anyone else. Maybe they weren't all bad. One day, many years after Samson's blinding, I said, the Philistines worshipped their gods in the city's primary temple. The leaders said, let us bring out Samson to mock him. They did. The blind warrior asked the boy leading him to set him between the two central pillars holding up the temple. There Samson prayed, Lord, let me die with my enemies. Give me the strength to push down these pillars. Afterwards, Samson strained. As the Philistines watched, the spirit of the Creator came upon him and he brought down the two pillars, and that brought down the temple full of Philistines. The holy text says he killed more that day than he had during his life. Baba Gobo squinted at me. What is your point? The Samson Protocol means I will bring down the temple on both of us, killing all of us as I destroy the Forerunner artifact. No, the Starkian whispered. That is blasphemous sacrilege. You would be branded an outlaw, and your people hounded to the ends of the universe. I laughed. Do you hear yourself? You threaten to destroy my people, extinction for mankind. That doesn't matter to a race already slain. Do you plan to kill us twice? You do not possess the means to destroy the artifact, Baba Gobo said. I assure you I do. You fitted nuclear warheads onto the relic? he asked. Among other things, I lied. You are an animal, Baba Gobo said. It is vile to destroy an artifact of the first ones. It is unclean to set explosives on the shrine. I abhor you, beast. Listen to me well. Many think lowly of the Starkians, but today I will sacrifice my flotilla to rid the universe of monsters like you and your ilk. Prepare to die, Creed Beast. The explosions will destroy you too, I said. Surprised at his reaction. I have no interest in your... The Starkian paused, and he glanced to his left, my right. Commander, Ella said, I'm receiving a communication from Ceres. Dr. Sant would like to address the two of you. Baba Gobo regarded me. I have received a call from Dr. Sant, a lohar of Orange to Mica. Did he not return from hyperspace via the artifact? He did, I said. Let us hear what the noble Lohar wishes to say, the Starkian told me. Why did Dr. Sant call now? Could he have been listening to our two-way conversation? Did the Lohar have military-grade spy devices on Ceres? What did that say for Ella's assurance that Sant would favor us? The split screen changed. The image of the Starkian fleet disappeared. In its place, Dr. Sant appeared in his orange robe. Like the Starkian and me, Dr. Sant used a universal translating device to communicate with the two of us. I thank both of you gentlemen for taking my call, Sant said. Baba Gobo stiffened. I hope you are not equating the beast with me. Do you not realize he has just threatened to destroy the Forerunner object? Yes, I know, Dr. Sand said. That is why I wish to address you both. You are a Loha, Baba Gobo said. Of all the races, I know you serve the artifacts with the greatest zeal. Surely you realize that we must expunge mankind from the Star Lanes? Dr. Sand said nothing although he turned his yellow eyes onto the Starkian. There was something unsettling about Sant, 
something I'd never noticed before. It was a new majesty, perhaps, an extra weight or gravity to his bearing. Was that due to the jelk machine? You weren't with us in hyperspace, Baba Gobo, Dr. Sand said. I joined the humans as they battled down the portal planet to the artifact in the center of the great forerunner machine. I saw Commander Creed in his element. What is more, I saw him walk the curve toward the ancient residence in the inner torus of the object. He disappeared into an olden building. There he did communicate with the relic, learning the construct's name. He bargained with the tool of the First Ones. In a moment of time, the object now in the solar system's asteroid belt left the portal planet and came here. The object has blessed the humans with its presence. It judges them, Baba Gobo. The Lohars await the artifact's word on the nature of man. Are the humans beasts as you subscribe, or should mankind join the civilized races as guardians of life? He threatened to destroy the ancient shrine, Baba Gobo said. He is the object's guardian, Dr. Sant said. He uses what weapons he has. Yes, Commander Creed is crude and bloodthirsty, yet he saved our universe from destruction. We Starkians will make better guardians, Baba Gobo said. Slowly, Dr. Sant shook his head. This cannot be. The object has chosen its residence. Here it must stay until it chooses otherwise. The Starkian's eyes gleamed wetly. I acknowledge your rank, Dr. Sant. You are a chosen one of the relic. I bow before you. Yet you should know, Acolyte, that you have just sealed humanity's fate. I will annihilate them and take up residence in this star system. Then you must slay me as well, Dr. Sant said. The Lohars will, of course, learn of this. Then you will have to pay the price for spilling my blood. The Starkian stared at Dr. Sant, seeming deflated. Is this your final word? It is, Dr. Sant said. You would do this for these beasts? the Starkian asked. I would do it because the artifact has told Commander Creed its name. This is true? Baba Gobo asked. It is true, said Dr. Sant. The Starkian sniffed several times. He avoided looking at me. We will leave the solar system, Doctor. As one who journeyed with a forerunner construct, you have my envy and highest regard. Your words have weight, Acolyte. I cannot carry them on my shoulders. Thus I retreat before your glory. Dr. Sant bowed his head and then his image disappeared from the screen. Finally, Baba Gobo glanced at me. There was venom in his eyes. This isn't the end of it, beast. When the Lohar... The Starkian snarled. Then his image vanished. That left me alone with my thoughts. Dr. Sant had ridden on the artifact when it teleported away from the portal planet. I had gone inside the object and actually spoken with it. Yet I was the beast and Dr. Sant the holy acolyte. In that moment, with a burning in my chest... I vowed to make the aliens of all stripes recognize that humans were equal to any other race in our galaxy. Chapter 7 The Starkian flotilla left the same way it had come, through the Neptune jump gate. Seven months later, Dr. Sant informed me that he and his fellow Orange to Micah Lohars were going home. After what had happened with Baba Gobo, that sounded ominous. Other extraterrestrials feared the Lohars, but had nothing but contempt for us humans. With the last Lohars gone, what would stop bloodthirsty aliens from ransacking the solar system? An orange Tamika starship docked near Ceres. 
A day later, Dr. Sant and I walked along an underground corridor jackhammered from the asteroid's rock. I wore my Navy uniform, complete with a military cap and sidearm, my forty-four Magnum. I'd finally gained back all my lost weight and felt strong again. The last of Sant's needler venom had disappeared from my system. At no time had he shown any inclination to recall his assassination attempt against me, nor did he ever speak about the Shi Feng. Dr. Sant wore his former silver and black garment with orange chevrons. With his greater height, the tiger towered over me. I'm not sure I understand why you're leaving, I said. I thought you wished to continue studying the artifact. As we walked down the rock corridors, with the stark lights shining down from the ceiling, Dr. Sant glanced at me sidelong. Since going under Ella's mind machine, he had become less talkative and more contemplative. His strides lengthened and his furry brow wrinkled in thought. I even noticed that his whiskers twitched. Finally, in a grave voice, he said, Rumors have percolated from deep within the Jelk Corporation. What kind of rumors? I asked. They have invasion troubles, he said. From where? I asked, thinking about my nightmare of Abaddon. And how did you learn of this? Yes, that is the question. From where, I mean? The captain of Royal Sovereign, the Orange Tamika warship docked outside, has told me these rumors. They are food for serious contemplation. The captain told me some believe center galaxy aliens have invaded down our spiral arm into Jelk territory. Others think that a secret cabal among them is attempting a Jelk coup. A small number of religious adepts believe Abaddon has escaped from hyperspace with a Karg task force. I felt cold inside. Abaddon is in our universe? You're sure of this? Dr. Sant shook his head. I make no such claim of surety. I relate to you rumors, nothing more. This we do know. Something has shaken the Jelk Corporation. What's more, various Saurian fleets have departed their jump-off points. By this I mean those fleets no longer poise like spears to jab into Jade League star systems. That's good news, isn't it? I asked. Sant stared down at me. I'm not talking about Abaddon and some cargs making it into our universe, I said. That would be terrible. Unless they brought Jennifer with them. Then I could try to free her. No, Sant said, horrified. You must never attempt such a thing. I snorted. Are you kidding me? She was my woman. If I have a shot at freeing her, you'd better believe I'll take it. That would be ill-considered indeed. The omens all point to one conclusion. If you ever meet Abaddon face to face, nothing will ever be the same for any of us. It was my turn to stare. I hated this oblique stuff. Besides, could Sant really be serious about this? What would that make my dream? Would it be a coincidence, or could the demon lord speak across a thousand light years? The Lohars had an oracle, their greatest forerunner artifact. It liked making ambiguous statements. I think the policy had rubbed off onto Dr. Sant. Do you think the Jelk problem is with Abaddon? I asked. I have no way of knowing, Sant said. I believe it highly unlikely, though. The center galaxy invasion sounds more plausible to me. I nodded. Sure, Doc. I mean... Doctor. Like all Lohars I've ever met, Sant was a bear concerning protocol. They disliked informality. The Jelk are having trouble with someone or something. It has caused them to pull back Saurian crude task forces from the frontier. Now, why is that a problem again? I did not say it was. Come on, Doctor, you're acting worried over this. Sure, you're trying to hide it, but I know you, remember? His whiskers twitched. You are observant and rash. A unique combination. 
I wonder if that is the source of your remarkable strength. No, it's a bowl full of Wheaties every morning, I said. I do not understand, Sant said with a frown. It doesn't matter. What's troubling you? Is there something I can do to help? Dr. Sand halted and fingered his gaudy ring. His stare became intent as he studied the rose in the bubble. With a swift move, he took off the ring, holding it up to a ceiling light. Do you know what this ring signifies? I wanted to say a lack of artistic taste. Instead, I just shook my head. It is an ancient heirloom, my family symbol. My father gave it to me. His father gave it to him. My great-grandfather accepted it as a token from the Orange to Mica Regent Emperor. Wait a minute. I thought all Lohar emperors belonged to Purple to Mica. No, Sant hissed. The Purple are upstarts. Over two hundred years ago, they purloined the throne from Orange to Mica. It almost brought open revolt among the Lohars. What stopped it? I asked. The Saurian fleets poised to strike deep into Jade League territory, Sant said. I blinked several times. Sure, that made sense. Historically, what kept allies together? A larger threat. During World War II, the Soviets and Americans joined hands against Hitler. Once the Fuhrer died and Nazi Germany lay in ruins, the Russians and Americans soon began the Cold War. They didn't have a larger threat binding them together anymore. In this case, the once threatening Saurian fleets were like Nazi Germany. Do all Jade League members like each other? I asked. No, Sant said. Many loathe the very scent of other races. What about the different Tamikas? I asked. You are shrewd, Commander. The purple Tamika Emperor has moved openly against orange Tamika. Our dreadnoughts and their elite crews died in hyperspace. Because of that, we have become weak. Some believe the Emperor will attempt to eliminate orange Tamika altogether, securing the throne for generations to come. And he's making these moves now because the Saurian fleets no longer wait to attack? I asked. You ask that as if the Emperor is foolish. The Saurian fleets have not only retreated, but also traveled deep into Jelk Corporation territory. In some fashion, the Jelk are divided or under assault. There has not been such an occurrence for time immemorial. Maybe it's a Jelk trick, I said. They're cunning enough to do something like that. I mean, pull everything back and leak rumors that a terrible invasion has brought this about. Then, once the Jade League breaks into conflict, the Saurian fleets will return with a vengeance, cleaning up. I agree that is a possibility, Sant said. It's what makes this a difficult decision. You mean you're leaving the solar system? I asked. Instead of answering me, Dr. Sant raised the gaudy ring a little higher. This is my most precious possession. I have worn it with pride. Now, Commander Creed, I give it to you. Sant extended his long arm, shoving the ring in my face. I reacted hastily without really thinking about what I was doing. Oh, well, thanks, I said, taking the ring. Yeah, this is something, I said, hefting it. The ring was heavier than it looked. I'll treasure this all my life. Sant closed his eyes, nodding with seeming appreciation, as if this was a holy ceremony. Maybe it was. When he opened his orbs, he watched me expectantly. Uh, oh, I said, beginning to understand. No doubt I was supposed to give him something equally precious in return. This was a swap. I happened to be wearing my forty-four. I began unbuckling my gun belt. No, Sant said. I could not accept a weapon of war, especially one that killed the Emperor's daughter-wife. Oh, I said. 
Well, I'm not sure what I could give you, then. Dr. Sand smiled serenely. There is a boon I would ask of you. Sure, I said. You know the name of the Forerunner artifact. I sure do, I said. Dr. Sand waited expectantly. Maybe I should have just told him. I didn't want to, though. The tiger had shot me with poison slivers. Screw him. He was supposed to aid us, not us him. I do not ask for such a thing for myself alone, Sand said. It is for Orange to Micah that I ask, the brother-in-arms who died for you and your assault troopers, allowing them to reach the center of the portal planet. How does knowing the artifact's name help Orange to Micah? I asked. Dr. Sand's serene look became strained. I don't think he liked my question. I am not here to bargain, Sant said. Of course you are, old son. For all I knew, the ring was bric-a-brac, a worthless piece of junk. Sant might be pulling a fast one, and I didn't like it. Several months ago, I saved you from the Starkians, he told me. Yes, you did, I said, and you have my most profound gratitude for doing it. I'm the one the artifacts spoke and listened to, yet the baboons weren't impressed with me. You just rode on the relic, and they seemed to think you were some holy man because of it. Why did they have the difference of reactions between the two of us? I asked. Dr. Sant stiffened, and his fingers twitched. Had I hit a nerve? Maybe I should just make up a name and give it to him. I rejected the idea. You need to let me know exactly what's going on here before I give you the artifact's name, I said. The tiger seemed to consider that. You are a wily. I think Sand almost called me a beast, barely stopping himself. You are a wily dealer, he said. Because of my journey with an artifact, I am an acolyte now. The Starkian recognized the change in me. I have begun a holy trek, a soul journey. As the speaker for the Saul object, my words have gravity. Wait a minute. Why are you the speaker? If anyone should be the speaker, it's me, I said, jabbing a thumb against my chest. No, Sant said, horrified. I raised my eyebrows. Forgive me, Commander Creed. Even after these past years, you are new to the Jade League. You have an exalted post as guardian of the object, but you are not an accredited acolyte. I am Lohar. I have ridden the relic. I have studied it and now will return to the Empire to speak my words to whoever will listen. This was rich. After all humanity had done for the Lohars, we were still little more than beasts in Dr. Sant's eyes. In other words, I said, you're going to create trouble for the Purple Tamika Emperor, but you're going to do it with religious coloring, hiding behind your new status. Please, Commander Creed, I ask that you speak with decorum and forego your crudities. I kept thinking about Sant pulling the trigger seven times and the Shifang blowing themselves up to kill me. That's right, I said hotly. I'm only a barbarian guardian, one of the only people an artifact has ever talked to. Oh, by the way, how many artifacts have told Alohar their name? Only the high priests would know such a thing, Sant said, stiffening. You know what I think? I asked. If an artifact talked to me, that means I outrank everyone in the Acolyte Department. Sant's eyes darted away from mine. I wondered if I'd hit another nerve. Frankly, I hardly cared. Look, Doctor, I said. You and I have been through a lot together. I saved your bacon on the portal planet. The assault troopers saved the universe. Yet what do we find? Insults by everyone who thinks we're nothing but beasts or barbarians. Well, I'm sick of it. No, I'm not giving you the object's name. You can take your ring back if you want. I thrust it at him. 
Sant's eyes widened and his whiskers stood straight out. With a lightning move, he snatched his gaudy ring, stuffing it in a pocket. You have insulted me, he said. Yeah, right, I said. I almost told him how he'd shot me seven times. Instead, I said, you've insulted me throughout this entire conversation. You don't see me sulking about it. I told myself to calm down. The tiger was an ally. He'd helped us just seven months ago with the Starkians. Look, Sant, you gave me your ring to try to bribe me. I'm betting knowing the name of the artifact would be just about the biggest thing to hit the Lohar Empire. And you want me to just give it to you? I don't think so. Dr. Sant hissed with outrage and needle-thin claws popped out of his fingertips. I stepped back, thinking, Here we go again. I drew my forty-four. You have committed a grave error, Captain Creed. Well, how about that, Doc? I said. My gun hand rock steady. He drew himself to his full height, and it seemed he might curse me. Then suddenly the claws slid back into their sheaths. His shoulders sloped like normal, and he nodded. Was that a result of Ella's protocols at work in his mind? I was an alien contact officer before I became an acolyte, he said. You humans are different from us, Commander Creed. I feel sorry for you, not because you will not give me the name. You are correct. I sought to trick the name from you. It was unworthy of me and unworthy of you. I am sorry, Commander. So am I, Dr. Sant. Whatever happens, I wish you luck. I put away the forty-four. May the Great Maker guide your way, Sant said. You are going to need all your courage and guile to keep your artifact. A time of troubles is upon us. If the Jelk Corporation splinters or falls into civil war, I doubt the Jade League or the Lohar Empire will survive it. That will mean every race for itself. You earthlings are too few to last in such a state. Yeah, well, we'll see about that, I said. Dr. Sant held up a hand in a salute. Then he turned away, heading for a hatch that would take him to the Orange to Mica warship. I wondered if I'd ever see him again. I heard a hatch clang shut. I knew I had to talk with Diana. If things were starting to fall apart out there, we needed a plan. We couldn't just hang on anymore. We had to begin building a fully defensible solar system. Chapter 8 After Dr. Sant and his Orange to Micah Lohars left, we had the solar system all to our lonesome. For the first time since the aliens had shown themselves, we were the only beings here. Despite his galling nature, Baba Gobo had taught me a valuable lesson. Actually, he just affirmed what I'd already known and then forgotten. To every alien we'd met, men were beasts at worst and barbarians at best. The Lohar Emperor had refused to admit us to the Jade League. He'd thought about letting the Forerunner Guardians join, a back door for humans, so to speak. Even that had been shot down in the end. It left us in a precarious spot. Baba Gobo had probably backed down to Dr. Sand for another reason, one worth considering. The might of the Lohar Empire had stood behind Sant. What stood behind us? Not a damn thing. I sipped wine at a candlelight dinner with Diana. Dr. Sant had left two months ago. Since then, three voyagers in three different alien vessels had entered the solar system. Each had claimed pilgrim status, wishing to view the Sol object. Each had left a bad taste in my mouth. They felt like con men casing a joint, studying the security systems for a future heist. In seven years we'd had six pilgrims. Now we'd had these three in quick succession. As we ate, I told Diana about my worries. We were in a special dining area of Mars Base. A ceiling window showed the stars. Side screen showed the lonely rock formations of Mars at night. 
To cap it, the Amazon queen had worn sheer silks to the meal. Even after all these years, she had to play her predator's games. I could see her breasts under the fabrics, her rouged nipples. She'd called me staring several times, and it made her smile. A shark couldn't have grinned with more malice as a morsel swam toward its jaws. Most of me said to go ahead and roll in the sack with her. It would be well worth it. A smaller voice warned me she was a honey trap meant to bury me deep. I had no doubt Diana knew sex techniques that would leave me gasping. She also had a monstrous ambition to run everything. Was this how she'd taken care of Loki? There had been three members of the Earth Council before I'd left for hyperspace years ago. No matter how hard I tried to find out, no one could tell me what had happened to the ex-Swedish billionaire. It simply disappeared one day. I realized that Diana had no qualms about using whatever tools she needed to achieve her ends. Understanding that, I tore my gaze from the peaches under her silks and found her licking her lips. We don't have to be adversaries, Creed, she purred. In lieu of answering her, I sipped wine. The candlelight in the center of the table flickered, causing shadows to shift along the walls. I don't know why, but it reminded me of everything the coming of the aliens to Earth had permanently stolen from us. There would never be movies in San Francisco with a hot date, or pizza and beer on a Friday night after sweaty games of basketball with my friends. That Earth had died. Despite all our automated factories attempting terraforming, we possessed a poisoned planet with bitter survivors hanging on by our fingernails. We have to do something new, I said. That sounds erotic, she told me. I clunked my wine goblet onto the table and leaned back in my chair. Do you remember Demetrius? Of course, she said. He was a good man. He was a rugged son of a bitch, I said. An ex-SAS trooper who died on the portal planet. He gave his life so we could keep on living. He had been Diana's bodyguard in the early days when the freighters had been grounded on Earth. The man had joined me on the expedition to save the universe. He'd given his life so the rest of us could live. I thought about Demetrius, how I had to turn his sacrifice into something lasting. Okay, Diana said, frowning. You're not tracking my thoughts, I said. This. I waved my hand to indicate the room and everything it entailed. Is our responsibility. You and me, Diana, we're running the show. Mankind lives or dies on our decisions and actions. We don't have time for games. If we don't live, are we really alive? She asked. There's no point to existing if we don't enjoy ourselves sometimes. Take a break tonight, Creed. You've earned it. I snorted. If I genuinely believed you cared a whit about me as a person, I might find your seductive ways alluring. As it is, I realize you're just trying to manipulate me so you can gain more power. Something hardened in her eyes, reminding me of a boa constrictor squeezing its prey. That disappeared a moment later, and she smiled. The sexual wattage pouring out of her almost made me reconsider the offer. As I debated with myself, the tip of her tongue slowly dragged across her lip. I admit it, my groin stirred. The lady was sexy. I had to do something, or I was going to rip off her clothes and do her on the table. So I laughed, stood and swept the wine goblet off the tablecloth, letting the glass shatter against the video of Mars at night. Diana flinched in surprise. Wait here, I said. In three swift strides, I opened the door and moved into the hall, shouting for N7. The android opened a different door, giving me an inquiring glance. He looked like a choir boy with soft blonde hair. He wasn't that, but one of the most dangerous beings on our side. He wore a naval uniform and cap. He'd been with me in the artifact's inner sanctum, meaning that N7 also knew the object's name. No one thought to ask him, though. Lohars, in particular, had an aversion to treating androids as people. Did androids lack souls? 
I suppose so, because the Jelk built them to order. Even so, N7 had become one of my brothers in arms. I told him my needs. N7 retreated and returned shortly with a heavy coat. Thanks, I said. With the coat, I returned to my dinner date with Diana. Here, I said, tossing the long garment across the table. Put this on. The coat draped carelessly across Diana as she lounged in her chair, messing her hair. She studied me, finally lifting the coat and running her fingers through her hair. You're making a mistake, she said. Yeah? How? I asked. You should treat me with greater respect. If you want respect, give respect. What do you think I did by wearing this gown for you? The gown is your teeth, Diana. You're trying to sink your claws into me. I'm interested, but not enough to give you an edge. The great Commander Creed is afraid of me? She asked in a mocking tone. Is that what you're saying? Call it what you want. This is ridiculous, she said. But if this is what you're ordering me to do... She slid the gown off her left shoulder. I imagine she planned to strip in front of me. My gaze locked onto that shoulder. Maybe I was being ridiculous. I don't know. Ever since I'd had the nightmare of Abaddon, I'd begun missing Jennifer all over again. I had an ache, and Diana tempted me. Sex and love were powerful facets of human behavior. People toyed with them at their peril. If I slept with Diana... No, that's not going to happen. But in order to stop that from occurring, I had to change the dynamics. A man can resist sexual allurement for a time. If he remains where the enticement is, though, eventually he'll give in. I had to retreat from the enticement, or it would overwhelm me. Some things are simply too hard to resist over time. I know, that sounds weeny. A tough guy was supposed to be able to bed any beauty without a thought. To screw like a dog supposedly proved a man's virility. I happened to disagree with the principle. I'd always believed in choosing one woman and committing to her alone. Jennifer was my woman. Why otherwise did I have nightmares about my abandoning her? Even after the intervening years, the guilt tore at me was why. I refused to dally with Diana while Jennifer... As Diana removed her silk gown, I turned my back on her. Really, Creed? The Amazon Queen asked. I'm going to leave, I told her. After a short pause, Diana said, It's safe, Mr. Boy Scout. You can turn around now. I did. She sat in her chair with the coat buttoned all the way to her throat. The silk gown lay on the floor beside her. After all my interior moral posturing, I still managed to wonder if she was naked under the coat. I couldn't believe it. I found myself wanting to rip off the coat and lay her down on the table. Just a second, I said. I stepped into the hall again and shouted for N7. He showed up. You're coming with me to take notes, I said. The android frowned. I have no need of taking notes, Commander. I can remember everything said. My brain core has a computer's total recall. Fine, I said. Sit and listen, then. Come with me. Diana looked annoyed when I returned with N7. I thought she might protest. Finally she shrugged, tossing her luxurious hair. As N7 sat in a corner, I talked for a time about our military situation, finally adding... Our nearest neighbors have bigger fleets than we do and industrial bases. They also have planetary populations. If the two power blocks splinter, it's going to become a grab-what-you-can type of galaxy. How can we compete in that kind of environment? We have our forerunner object, Diana said. The solar system has become holy ground. Yeah, maybe, I said. But we just saw the Starkians trying to grab our artifact. Sure, we can stop a pirate in his spaceship from hijacking the relic. Our ten starships are too many for a lone operator. What can we do against a planet-based foe with a military fleet? 
The obvious answer is that we have to find our own allies, Diana said. We have to become enmeshed with others so we're too big to attack. I agree, I said. But who's going to ally with animals? They can't really mean that about us, she said. And Seven cleared his throat. I laughed sourly. He's going to tell you they mean it, all right. And Seven nodded. The commander is correct. Are you saying we won't be able to find allies? Diana asked me. Not as we are now, I said. Either we have to change how the aliens think about humans, or we have to seriously strengthen our star system's defenses. We need to trade, then, Diana said. Will others trade with beasts? I asked. If it's to their benefit, I think they would, Diana said. Okay, what will we trade? We've been buying these automated factories with fissionable materials and works of art, Diana said. Why not use those items on the open market? Well, first, I said, the Lohars have traded with us because they owed us for the 100,000 assault troopers lost in hyperspace. We haven't been paid tit for tat. If we're going to really trade with others, we'll need mining equipment. N7 squirmed on his chair. Do you want to add something? I asked him. Indeed, N7 said. At the moment, we possess no mining equipment. On Earth we do, I said. We have the one operating mine, he said. As you know, most of the metallic objects on Earth have badly rusted. Well, how about extracting ores from our asteroids, I asked. We lack the needed equipment to do that, N7 said. We lack pretty much everything, Diana said. And it seems like we have no way of getting a starter kit, as it were. The automated factories we received from the Lohars barely produce enough to keep the freighters running. Most of their hardware works on restoring the atmosphere. As it is, we're scraping by. Nodding, I said. It's as I thought. Humanity is in a hole. We bought our few starships with the lives of 100,000 assault troopers. The Lohars were supposed to be grateful. Now they're on to the next thing. Conveniently having forgotten about our sacrifices. Commander, N7 said. I have a thought. Go ahead, I said. Dr. Sant told us the Saurian fleets have retreated, N7 said. Their hasty reassignment likely means certain Jelk Corporation worlds are unprotected. What are you suggesting? Perhaps you could send a ship or two to a mining world, N7 said. You might be able to land and take what you need, along with mining androids to work the machines. Diana laughed throatily. That's very clever, N7. You want us to free your kind, is that it? It has crossed my mind, the android admitted. Vikings, I said. You want us to go a Viking? Both N7 and Diana turned to me. With the flat of my right hand, I slapped the table. It made Diana start and caused cutlery to jangle against the plates. We'll be star Vikings, I said, liking the idea more and more. We don't have anything to trade, at least not yet, or in any real quantity. All the aliens think of us as animals anyway. Therefore, we use the one thing we were able to buy, our ten starships. There's a problem with your plan. Diana said. If those ships are raiding the space lanes, what will protect the freighters back here? Hmm, I said, pondering the idea. We can't be obvious about this. Ten ships might be too many. Whatever we do, though, we're going to have to move fast. We need tech, we need tools, and we need more starships. If the Saurian fleets really have retreated, now's the time to strike and grab some of the things we need. Yes, I like your idea, N7. I don't, Diana said. Whose starships do we use? Not mine, I'll tell you. We only have so much ordnance. I mean missiles, mines, and laser coils. If you become a pirate... Viking, I said. Names don't matter, Diana said. I think they do. She shook her head as if I was simple. 
Jelk Corporation planets will have missile defenses, I'd bet, and planetary beams. You won't be able to just swoop down and make yourself rich. It's time to take risks, I said. You're right about that. With an elbow on the table, I made a fist and rested my chin on it. Okay, you don't want to risk your precious ships. I'll use one of mine, then. It's time to make a trial run. I'll need a freighter, though, to carry our loot. We can't afford to waste any of our freighters, Diana said. We have too few as it is. Wrong, I said. We can't afford not to use them. But I'll tell you what. Loan me a freighter, and I'll give you a percentage of our take. The Amazon Queen studied me, and I could see the calculations in her eyes. Finally, she asked, How much of a percentage? We spent the next two hours haggling. Star Vikings. I liked the name. It was better than Forerunner Guardians. It was an Earth name rather than one the aliens had coined for us. Now we had to decide which star system to strike. Chapter 9 Several days later, I took the Aristotle, a former Lohar cruiser, and the Maynard Keynes, a scow of a Jelk freighter. Diana had given me her worst vessel, not that I could blame her. Unfortunately, the engines broke down after the sixth jump. Going through a jump gate took its toll on the passengers. Flu-like symptoms struck just about everyone, even our android. It also produced wear and tear to the equipment. Thus, for three days, all my engineers and N7 struggled on the freighter's propulsion systems, trying to get it mobile again. Luckily, this was an empty system. There was no one to give us grief. It had a brown dwarf for a star and burnt-out husks for planets. None of the world's contained atmospheres. Most were ice balls with particles of nickel iron and rock. On the third day, Ella Timoshenko found a drifting body on her scanner. It turned out to be a Lohar soldier in wrecked, powered armor. How long do you think he's been adrift? Ella asked. I shrugged. I didn't know and I didn't care. The raid weighed me down with responsibilities and worries. This wasn't anything like joining Prince Venturi before on Indomitable. There hadn't been any choices last time. The Kargs would break into our universe, and that would be the end of life as we knew it. Here, I could make good choices and bad ones. The wrong decisions would mean the end of the human race. Talk about piling on pressure. I felt the weight of past and future generations squeezing me down. Finally, the Maynard Keynes could move again. The endless work had left our engineers exhausted, though. I let them rest and kept the two starships where they were. Soon enough, everyone would have to work at peak efficiency. I lay on my cot, staring at the ceiling. If you guessed that I was having second thoughts, you'd be right. I didn't mind raiding the Jelk Corporation. That wasn't the problem. I wondered about scale, though. This would solve our dilemma in a pinprick fashion. We needed strategic answers. Alliance with the Jade League, full-bore military and economic assistance would have made a world of difference to what we planned. That's what I'd originally thought I had been buying with the agreement to put 100,000 assault troopers into harm's way. It turned out I'd been a fool. Despite the few automated factories they'd brought, the Lohars had snookered us, and I didn't like it. With my fingers laced behind my head, I told myself I had to rid all thoughts of squeamishness from my heart. This was like a lioness with a den full of cubs. She went out and killed a baby gazelle or slew the mother and let the baby starve to death. I wasn't in some airy fairy tale where the universe played patty cake with the Marquis of Queensberry rules to guide us. This was the law of tooth and claw. Survival of the fittest, baby. What did that mean? It meant I had to play this as ruthless as I could. I hadn't come to another race and laced their world with nukes. The Tigers, and in a way, the gel could come and done it to us. Now we scrambled for any advantage we could eke out. If I failed, humanity sank out of sight, never to lift its head again. So be it. 
I would do whatever. A knock at my hatch startled me. I swung my feet off the cot, stood and pressed a button. The hatch opened and N7 stood there with rolled up star charts in his arms. Do you remember you wanted to look at these? he asked. Sure, I said, having completely forgotten. Let's take a gander. For the next several hours, N7 and I pored over his charts. He knew a lot about this region of Jelk space and our target, the Damar star system. It had an O spectral class star, a bluish-white furnace that burned at 30,000 Kelvin on the surface. The system lacked any terrestrial planets. In fact, it only had one Jupiter-sized gas giant. The moons of that Jovian world were heavy with mined ores. The Damar system also boasted inner, middle, and outer asteroid belts. Those, too, were rich in thorium and deuterium, a veritable motherload of mineral wealth. The system contained a single huge habitat known as the Damar Star City. It wasn't a pleasure palace or breeding ground for Saurians. Instead, it had a giant processing center with sideline industries that produced finished goods. N7 stood beside the table with a star chart magnetized in place. Using a forefinger, he stabbed the star city. This is my origin point, he said. This is where I was built. I rubbed my jaw thoughtfully. Perhaps as important for you, here in the habitat are many military articles. Yeah? I asked. I suspect you will find automated missile systems and beam cannons, N7 said. There will, of course, be mining equipment. Or, if you prefer, you can take gas giant scoopers to mine Jupiter and Saturn for deuterium. Seems too good to be true, I said. Agreed, N7 said. This was the base system for the 10th Saurian Task Force. The fleet wasn't on the frontier between the Jade League and Jell Corporation territory. This was a secondary force meant to reinforce wherever needed. And you think those warships are gone? I asked. N7 straightened. I do not presume to know, Commander. I work only off the information you received from Dr. Sant. Great, I said. Really, we're in the dark about just about everything. Yes. I gazed at the star chart and the Damar system in particular. If the Gel Corporation was in trouble, I said, I mean, against invaders, it seems as if the secondary or reinforcing fleet would be the first one to go. That is logical, N7 said. The question is, will the Jade League members already have invaded these regions? That is another reason to try here, N7 said. Logically, the Jade League members would wish to scour star systems close to their base worlds. This is farther away. Do you think Dr. Sant told us the truth? I have no way of verifying his words, N7 said. Yeah, I said, rubbing my jaw again. I had a bad feeling about this, and I couldn't fool myself. If we failed here, things would likely get even darker in a hurry. I'm sure you've heard of deep-sea fish that live in a world of eternal gloom. Well, I mean the fish that used to live in the subterranean reaches of the Earth's oceans. I'm sure the Bioterminator had settled down there by now, too. My point is pressure. Those fish had learned to live with an intense pressure per square inch that would have crushed a human. No submarine had ever gone to such a depth, although a few bath escapes had. The fish could take intense pressure because their own bodies pushed outward. The funny thing occurred when that pressure stopped. If a fisherman hooked such a fish and reeled as fast as he could, the deep-sea creature would die. It couldn't live with the lesser pressure. What did any of that have to do with our raid? The Gel Corporation had put intense pressure against the Jade League for uncounted years. These last few years, and now even more so, the pressure had lifted. It was gone. Like those deep-sea fish, it appeared that most of the Jade League members didn't know what to do with the lesser threat. It had seemingly unhinged their thinking. 
It had also apparently opened old wounds among the members. What we found as we cruised the jump lanes in Jelk Corporation territory was a decided lack of Jade League vessels. Several times, Saurian scout ships hailed us. N7 responded, using old codes. The Saurian scout commanders always demanded to know why an old freighter accompanied an obvious Lohar military craft. N7 told them he was bringing the Lohar cruiser to Sector 8 headquarters for study. Each time, the Saurian commander grew utterly still on the viewing screen. Then he would hiss. After the hissing, the commanders told N7 to carry on. Sector 8 was code for secret mission. As had been the case many times in the past, N7 was the source of priceless information. I had a meeting with my main team, Ella, N7, Rollo, and Dimitri. I'd taken them with me, figuring I needed my best people to pull this off. Dmitri was a Zaporizhian Cossack from the Ukraine. They used to be a hard-riding, freedom-loving people from the steppes or plains of Russia and the Ukraine. They were supposed to be good fighters. Most people knew them as those acrobatic dancers who squatted low, folded their arms on their chests, and vigorously kicked out their legs. Dmitri was a solid, muscular man. Shorter than my 6'3". He had taken to wearing his hair in a straight-up brush cut. N7 had magnetized the chosen star chart on a wall. We stood beside it, me with a pointer in my hand. We're several jumps away from the Damar star system, I said. Now is the time to decide where in the system we should target. Any thoughts? I asked. I say we get in, hit, and get out as fast as we can. Dimitri said. That means we should strike a weak spot. So what's the easiest place to hit there? We all glanced at N7. I would imagine the outer asteroid belt, the android said. It's closest to the jump gate. Everything is relative, Ella said. We have to know the lay of the system better. What's the most heavily defended location? N7 pointed at the star city. That also happens to be the plum prize, I said. This is our first raid, and as far as we know, the first time the Damar system will have been hit since the Saurian task force left. Are they worried? Who knows? But once they've been hit, the word is going to go out. The second raid will be harder. This might be the time to strike big. I don't know why they wouldn't be ready for an assault now, Ella said. Because this is a secondary area. I said. As far as we know, no Jade League members have struck the Jelk Corporation frontier. The Jelk have been on the offensive for a long time, remember? They're not going to think of defense right away. At least that would be my guess. Still, Ella said. With the protecting fleet gone, those left at home have to be nervous. That is my own view, N7 said. Yeah, I said. Well, maybe we should try to put them at ease. Besides, I think the closer we can get to our target, the better for us. We don't want to trade shots with the Star City's laser batteries or defensive missiles. What do you suggest? Ella asked. I stared at the star chart. What had the old-time Vikings done? They used daring and cunning. I remember reading about one chieftain who pretended to die. The raiders had been pagans striking Christian Europe. The chieftain had his warriors tell the city fathers of one walled town that he'd become a Christian at death and wished for a Christian burial. The head priest had realized what a religious coup that would be. He'd forced the townspeople to consent, and he even began to write a letter to the Pope about it. Several days later, big Viking warriors carried the supposedly dead chieftain to the town's church. They had laid their spears and great axes under the faker. During the ceremony, the chieftain opened his eyes, rose with a gusty laugh, and pitched the weapons to his men. They went berserk and slew the city fathers and their guards. Then the Norse warriors rushed through the lanes to the main city gate, opening it to admit their hidden men outside. That night they sacked the town. It had been a Trojan horse kind of plan. With a grin, I told the others the story. 
I finished by saying, That's what we need to do with the Star City. Why there? Ella asked. The Star City will be the most heavily guarded place. Exactly, I said. If we can storm it, we'll have breached their main defenses. That means we'll be safe enough for a time to pick our plunder. There's another thing to consider. The Star City should have the kind of goods we need. Besides, the habitat sounds like the best place to use assault trooper tactics. How do you propose we trick the defenders? Ella asked. I glanced at N7. You know the Saurians much better than we do. You're going to have to think of something. We waited, and our golden-haired android blinked at the star chart. I have an idea, he said at last. Let's hear it, I said. And Seven began to speak. Two days later, we passed through the final jump gate to the target, entering the Damar star system. The Maynard Canes led the way. The much larger freighter used a barely working tractor beam to pull the shutdown Aristotle. If our ploy failed, it would take twenty solid minutes to activate the former Lohar cruiser to full capacity. We were attempting our own version of a Trojan horse attack, our very weakness demanded we do it this way. Inside the freighter were two thousand assault troopers, two thousand combat soldiers ready to try to turn the tide of history that swept against humanity. On the bridge I stood near N-7, who acted as the freighter captain. The intense Damar sun shined its fierce light. The star city orbited at a Mars-like distance. We're being hailed, Ella said who worked the communication system. N7 nodded for her to open channels. A moment later, on the main screen, a bedecked Saurian peered at our android. Saurians were two-legged walking lizards, looking like giant versions of the gecko from the old-time insurance commercials. The creature moved springier than a human would. Usually, a Saurian stood four or four and a half feet tall. They called themselves the family, and made better workers than they did fighters. I think the Jelk liked them because Saurians were easy keepers and bred like flies. You are not authorized to enter the Damar system, the Saurian hissed. He wore a uniform with fancy braid hanging down from the sleeves. I claim salvage rights to the ship I'm towing, N7 said. Under Article 9 of the Jelk Scavenger Code, I must be paid 30% of the vessel's worth. The Saurian eyed N7, finally saying, You're an android. That has no bearing on Article 9, N7 told him. No? The Saurian hissed. It appears your logic circuits are in full working order. Yes. N7 said in a mechanical fashion. As I watched the exchange, I could practically see the greed working in the Saurian's mind. He no doubt thought to cheat the foolish android of its treasure. Ella tapped her board, splitting the main screen. It continued to show the Saurian and now the Star City in the distance. The habitat was a great cylinder, many kilometers in length and width. By rotating, it created pseudo-gravity for its occupants. Three small pinpricks moved away from the platform. I pointed at them. Ella tapped her panel one more time. The three dots leapt in magnification. They were corvettes, star system patrol craft. The Aristotle could have beaten them in a straight fight, but we would have taken damage doing it. If the Star City had heavy beams, the enemy might even have destroyed our cruiser. No, we had to do it like this. You will bring your cargo to the number seven docking bay, the Saurian said at last. I understand, N7 said. I expect you to have my thirty percent finder's fee ready once I dock. You will receive a reward, android, the Saurian said. Never fear on that score. But if we see you deviate in the slightest, the Corvettes will annihilate your freighter and take the Lohar cruiser for our own. I claim independent locator status, N7 said. 
That is guaranteed by the Jelk scavenging regulations. We serve the Jelk Corporation, the Saurian said. You do not need to keep quoting your articles. This is my lucky find, N7 said. I will buy many upgrades with my new wealth. You are a wise android, the Saurian said. I will instruct the Judicator to ready your fee. A moment later, the Saurian blinked off the screen. He means to bilk you of your fee, Ella told N7. Saurians are quite transparent, N7 said. It is another reason the Jelk prefer them over most others. The family has never staged a successful rebellion against the Jelk anywhere. This would seem like the time to try it, I said. No, N7 said. Not if the main Saurian fleets are deep in the interior systems. As long as they are there, the fleets are hostages for the frontier region's good behavior, at least concerning Jelk protocols. N7 studied me. I understand you dislike the other race's view of humanity. It is even worse toward us, the androids. At least they treat humans as something living. To the others, we are simply machines. I didn't know what to tell N7, so I said nothing. For the next few hours, we moved toward the Star City. At the same time, the three corvettes drew closer to us. They're scanning our vessels, Ella said. Let them, I told her. Rollo's board beeped. They have radar lock on, he informed us. They figured out our ploy. Dimitri said. We're dead men. I have to admit that I didn't like how my heart rate increased. Radar lock-on had that effect. What do you think, N7? Is Dimitri right? It is possible, the android said. The laser cannons are hot, too, Rollo said, looking up from his board. What should we do, Commander? Complain, I said. Ella, hail the Star City. And Seven, I want you to seriously complain about this. What good will that do us if we're dead? Dimitri asked. Maybe they're just testing our reactions, I said. Dimitri stood there blinking in disbelief. Soon, N7 complained to the same Saurian he'd talked with earlier. You are a spy, the Saurian said. That is incorrect, N7 said. I am an honest trader. I will send inspectors onto your vessels, the Saurian said. Of course, N7 said. I welcome them. Let them come. I have nothing to hide. The Saurian eyed him, finally signaling someone off screen. You are a legitimate scavenger, android. Proceed to the docking bay. First, I want to know why you targeted my freighter, N7 asked. As I said, it is our procedure. No, N7 said. I have changed my mind about bringing the Lohar cruiser to you. I will take it elsewhere. It's far too late for that, android, the Saurian said. The corvettes will escort you to the docking bay. If you deviate from your course, they will disable your freighter and take the prize ship for the family. That is against Article 9, N7 complained. You have much to learn, android. Now do as I say, if you value a continued existence. I will comply, N7 said. But I plan to lodge a protest against these actions to the governing authority. The Saurian hissed before blinking off once more. Nineteen hours later, the Maynard Canes braked hard. The strain told on the ancient engines. Not only did the heavy thrust slow our mass, but that of the Aristotle as well. The Star City loomed before us, a gleaming cylinder spinning in the stellar void. The three corvettes paced us, the farthest a mere five hundred kilometers away. They were sleek vessels with stubby wings. At times, corvettes flew within planetary atmospheres. 
Their laser cannons were no longer hot, primed for firing, but they could become lethal in minutes. It is time to match velocities with the Star City, N7 said. Yeah, I said. Ella, you're remaining here to run communications. Rollo, Dimitri, let's get ready. We exited the bridge, hurrying to our soldiers in the main bay. I still used the Mongol system for the assault troopers instead of the legionary start we'd had with the Jelk Corporation. The greatest conqueror in Earth history had been Genghis Khan. His Mongols had swept over an incredible area, riding across degrees of longitude and latitude instead of just hundreds of miles. I decided to steal from the great Khan's bag of tricks. One thing he'd done was forge an iron law called the Yasa. We assault troopers had our own Yasa. One of its keys was never to leave one of our own behind on the field of battle. Another was to make the smallest combat group a band of brothers. That was an Arbon, ten brothers and sisters in arms. They lived and fought together and looked out for each other. Ten Arbons formed a company called a Zagoon of one hundred troopers. Ten Zagoons formed a Mingon of one thousand. Dimitri led one Mingon and Rollo the other. I had overall command. We went to our staging areas. Like the other assault troopers, I went to the heat unit holding my bio suit. The green light was on, as it should be. I opened the lid and pulled out a hefty black blob that was warm to my skin. I pushed it onto the decking where it quivered in anticipation. Taking off my shoes and clothes, I stepped naked onto the blob. Around me, others did the same thing. The substance oozed onto my legs, coating my flesh. It was a warm, comfortable sensation. As I've said before, this was second skin, symbiotic alien armor, genetically engineered for human use. Alive after a fashion, it could heal itself at times. The outer surface would harden, and it allowed the wearer to operate in a vacuum in outer space. The skin also amplified human strength. It was also capable of secreting a battle drug into our bodies when necessary. The familiar symbiotic skin rushed up my thighs, over my belly button, and didn't stop until it reached my chin. I put on my helmet and grabbed a gun, checking the battery pack. It had a bar symbol on it with the green all the way to the plus sign on top. The laser rifle had a full charge. We had taken to calling it a Bankuv assault rifle. Dmitri had told us about an experimental Russian laser, the design headed by a Dr. Bankuv. I liked the name because it was human. This was the largest bay, holding two thousand assault troopers. The headphones in my helmet crackled into life. Commander? Ella said. I'm here, I said into my microphone. There's a problem, she said. The Saurian just ordered us to remain several hundred kilometers from the main Star City docking bay door. And? I asked. The corvettes are closing in, she said. Worse, their laser cannons have just gone hot. The Saurian told me he's sending over an inspection team after all. Something must have given us away. I knew it, Dimitri cried. They're never going to let us enter the Star City. We're doomed. My spine tightened. I didn't like the feeling. What are we going to do? Dimitri asked me. Yeah, that was the question. Chapter 10 my plan rested on nifty little one Lohar flyers. We'd faced them in the Altair star system what seemed like a lifetime ago. The one-man sleds were fast, sported a laser cannon in front, and were meant for one Lohar legionnaire laying down to pilot it. Enough of my people had practiced with them on Deimos, one of the tiny moons of Mars, and off Ceres in our asteroid belt. There were three corvettes out there, a giant cylinder and likely hordes of Saurians waiting on it. Each of those creatures could pick up a wrench at the very least. Too many of them would have energy weapons. We had two thousand Star Vikings, assault troopers with pure hearts of gold, and not to put too fine a point on it, we had me. 
The way I saw it, we had no choice in this. We had to go balls out. I studied the schematic in my HUD. The last Corvette was too far away from us, staying 500 kilometers out. The other two were several minutes distant from our big Jelk freighter. No one was aboard the Aristotle. For this little game, it didn't count. I was hoping no one messed with it, either. We'd need the cruiser to get home. Okay, I said over a wide speaker. Here's how we're going to do it. Dimitri, half your Ming-on, will head for the nearer Corvette. We'll call that Enemy A. Rollo, half your Ming-on, will go for Corvette B. What about Corvette C? Rollo asked. Don't worry about it for now, I said. Rollo, I'm going to lead your B team against the Corvette. I want you to lead the rest of your troopers to the Star City. Dimitri, you're going to hit the A Corvette. Your second team will follow Rollo. That's too complex, Creed, Rollo said. Send me with my entire Ming-On at the Star City. Right, I said. I don't know what I was thinking. Command and control will be critical. Dimitri, your Ming-On will hit the Corvettes. I'll command one strike, you will lead the other. Roger, Dimitri said. After we settled that, I told them the rest of the idea, detailing their goals. In fifteen minutes, as the salt troopers dashed to their one-man flyers, we were ready to begin. I told Ella. She informed me N-7 had brought us to a relative halt. We had the same circular velocity as the spinning star city. That would be important. Here goes, I said. Good luck to everyone. Ella, open the main bay door. We lay or stood on the giant deck. Before us, massive bay doors began to open. One quarter of the two thousand Star Vikings would be part of the flyer teams. Three troopers apiece would use a Lohar sled. It was a tight fit, being the most people we could pack onto one. The rest of the Mingons would use thruster packs. They would be slower, but they would eventually get to their destinations. I was counting on the fact that each of us would make small targets. As strange as it seems, the Star City probably lacked the weapons to repel Vikings. They had lasers, missiles, and heavy guns to destroy ships, missiles, and possibly big enemy shells. Stars shined outside the bay doors. The O-class star blazed with blue-white light. Then I saw the Star City a gleaming cylinder with docking bays here at the one end. Do you see Corvette B? I asked the driver of my one-man flyer. I do, the woman radioed. Head straight for it, I told her. She turned the throttle. Thrust ignited from the back, and the narrow sled zoomed off the decking, heading for the dark object less than twenty kilometers away. What did the Saurians see? Maybe it was like bees boiling out of a hive. Maybe they didn't notice yet. They did the obvious, reacting against us by lighting up their lasers. Hot beams smashed against the huge gel freighter. If they had lit off a few small nukes instead, it would have finished us off. I didn't think they would do that for several reasons. For one thing, they were too close to the Star City. Nukes this near would damage it. For another, that would take initiative on the lizard's part. I'd fought Saurians before. The day after the Earth died, they'd landed in Antarctica to capture people. I'd turned the tables on them by attacking with ferocity from the get-go. That was my plan here today. I gripped the flyer as Bess, my pilot, pointed us at Corvette B. The small combat vessel had two main laser cannons. We had a small shooter, but I didn't give the command to fire yet. I had a different idea. A glance back showed me hundreds of glowing dots. Those were thruster packs pushing their troopers at the Star City. Every flyer we possessed aimed at a corvette. If the Saurian pilots woke up in time, they would take off, putting greater distance between the corvettes and us. What I was counting on was plain old-fashioned surprise. I had the initiative this time. Besides, we acted like pirates. That's what Vikings had been in the end. We stormed their ships like buccaneers with swords between our teeth. 
the enemy lasers began melting the freighter's outer hull. Now Saurian missiles zoomed at the Jelk hauler. They meant to take us down fast. What the Corvettes didn't do was leave. If they would wait just a few more minutes, we'd have them. My stomach tightened. Then I felt the edges of anger draining the fear away. I knew what was happening. The biosuit squirted combat drugs into my bloodstream. It wanted me to go berserk. Jelk technicians had made the symbiotic skins for humans. We'd modified them, but those modifications didn't always remain during battle. Now, I radioed. Beam at grid coordinates 10108. Our sled shifted. No doubt so Bess could aim at the targeted specifics. All around me, small laser beams fired at the enemy corvette. The Saurian vessel had grown in size. Each flyer laser now struck at exactly the same hull spot on the corvette. We needed a breach, and we needed it now. Luckily for us, corvettes didn't have heavy hulls or much armored plating. They were meant as patrol vehicles, needing speed more than anything else. An explosion behind me threw intense white light outward. I glanced back. The Maynard Canes expanded as light and debris blew outward. Had a Saurian laser hit the main fusion engine? This could be bad. It would be terrible news for the people orbiting Earth. Six hundred thousand humans had called the Maynard Canes home for the past few years. Now they would have to stay on the remaining freighters in Earth orbit. Increasing crowding. This freighter was never going anywhere again. With a shake of my head, I ignored that aspect. I found myself snarling, with my teeth clenched. The corvette loomed before us. I could see Saurians peering out of the main viewing port. Our many lasers struck the hull at the same spot, turning it cherry red. Deploy! I shouted. Bess's head twitched. It let me know I'd spoken too loudly. I pushed off the flyer. So did Bess and the other assault trooper. All around me, others did likewise on their sleds. I didn't know what happened elsewhere. Here, though, the plan worked. Flyer after flyer rammed against the corvette's heated hull. Most of the combat sleds crumpled into junk. The last few blasted a hole into the corvette. I gripped the controls of my thruster pack. Jamming my thumb on a button, I zoomed for the opening. All I needed was a few more seconds to reach the breach. I still couldn't believe the Saurian commander hadn't flown elsewhere. I guess surprise had the same effect on aliens that it had on people. Given time, they could decide on the right course of action. Having to think fast in the middle of a battle was something else entirely. Roaring at the top of my lungs, I flashed through the opening. Then I braced myself. Without my steroid-68 enhanced muscles, I never would have tried this. Without the biosuit to absorb much of the impact, I wouldn't have dreamed of smashing my way aboard another vessel. Too many troopers would break bones. Of that I had no doubt. The biosuits could harden there, though, and help them to walk during the fight. It would also pump drugs into the trooper and make him savage enough not to worry about the pain. I struck a bulkhead, and for several seconds at least I went unconscious. My eyes flew open. I lay in a heap with others sprawled around me. A few raced out a hatch to attack the Saurian crew. I shouted and gnashed my teeth. My head throbbed as I sat up, and I didn't know if I had any broken bones. Climbing to my feet, I found that my eyes didn't work quite right. Well, maybe they would get better as I went along. I staggered through the hatch, groaning, tasting blood in my mouth. I had a bonkoof in my hands. Three minutes later, I killed my first Saurian, beaming the suited creature in the chest, burning a hole there. That seemed to wipe away my pains, and I shouted with glee. What can I say? This was a fight to the death. I stormed Corvette B with the others. Like a blood-maddened weasel, I slaughtered lizards as if they were chickens in a henhouse. They didn't have a chance against us in this kind of savagery. 
Thus, twenty minutes after our breach through the hull, we gained control of the patrol vessel. As I said earlier, this was a ruthless situation. Mercy didn't have any part in the process. Would a lioness show a fawn mercy on the Serengeti plains of Africa? I would like to say I did this the nice way. I'd be a black-hearted liar, though. Dimitri and I conquered our corvettes. We both did it fast, leaving the interior bulkheads splattered with saurian blood. I'll give the lizards this. They never tried to surrender. It didn't matter, though. We were at the top of our game, and they were amateurs in face-to-face -face encounters. The last corvette rushed us as it spewed missiles and pumped its lasers. It would have been better off making a run for it. The last patrol vessel disabled Dimitri's corvette, shredding the outer hull with lasers. That killed five assault troopers, half the number lost in the engagement. We had already deployed our corvette's guns, obliterating the approaching missiles. If the enemy warheads had been nuclear, it would have been a different story. Corvettes didn't carry that kind of firepower, though. As the enemy zoomed closer, the Saurian captain switched targets, blasting my captured boat. He must have had a marksman over there. The lasers took out our guns. We had no more counter-battery fire. His missiles would have free reign against us, and that would likely kill too many assault troopers here. What the last Saurian captain must not have counted on was the seemingly immobilized Aristotle. Shortly after the first assault, troopers exited the freighter. N-7 and Ella, along with a handful of others, had relocated to the Lohar cruiser. They started the cold engines, working fast to get it mobile. Now the cruiser's main laser cannons fired red-hot beams. They were battle-grade weapons, not dinky patrol rays. Under the devastating assault, the last corvette shuddered, belching colored lights. Then it exploded, raining hull, bulkheads, engine parts, water, and bloody flesh in a growing radius. By that time, the belated Saurians in the Star City's tactical center began to act. They launched three missiles. One of them struck my corvette, disintegrating half the vessel. Another smashed against Dimitri's hulk without igniting. The last missile died to the cruiser's counter-battery fire. After that, Rollo put a stop to the tactical center's efforts. His thruster pack assault troopers gained control of the launch sites, disabling the tubes. From the cruiser, N-7 radioed the giant cylinder. The Saurians refused to answer. I guess they wanted us to knock before they talked. That's fine, because we could oblige them. With its tractor beam, the Aristotle grabbed the least wrecked corvette. The cruiser accelerated, dragging the corvette with it. At the last moment, N-7 roared past the great cylinder, turning off the tractor beam. The hulk of the corvette smashed against the Star City's hull, breaking through. Air spewed from the gaping hole, a hurricane force that must have meant plenty of Saurian dead inside. The next time N-7 radioed, a bedecked and glum-looking Saurian answered. You must surrender to me, N-7 said. Rollo had already broken into the main star city. Dimitri and I, together with our teams, jetted to join the action. We'd lost another thirty troopers when the missiles hit, but most of us had already evacuated the corvettes. I can ram the star city again, N-7 informed the Saurian. This is an outrage, the lizard said. You are a berserk android. We will decommission you and destroy your entire series. Very well, N7 said. With your words, you have sealed your fate. No, wait, the Saurian said. I must consider the rest of the family. On further thought, we will surrender on terms. I shut off my HUD display. Terms would be fine. The thing was to get in and get out with as little loss of human life as possible. We hit the jackpot with the Damar Star City. The difference between gross defeat and splendid victory could be a very close-run thing. This time we had come out on the right side. 
Instead of hundreds of dead troopers and capture for the rest of us, we had the pick of a major production center. Just as important, we grabbed several small haulers in port. The haulers were newer and sleeker than the old freighter we'd lost. For the next fifteen hours, our troopers loaded the haulers with missile defense systems. Improved iron domes, as the Israelis used to use before the coming of the aliens. We found planetary laser cannons, air cycles, newer laser coils, advanced targeting computers, floating gas giant scoopers, and the latest combat rifles and packs. Choosing what we should loot caused arguments among us. N7 suggested we take unpackaged androids along. Dimitri was against it, and Ella hemmed and hawed. In the end, I took several hundred. They might prove useful in the asteroids, because I ordered mining equipment loaded up, too. I not only wanted fish, but fishing poles. How many times could I pull the stunt we'd managed here today? Just before departure, I decided to quiz the senior Saurian. Rollo and N7 had been busy watching our captured lizards. They brought me an old boy. Like Earth crocodiles, Saurians continued to grow as long as they lived. That made it difficult for the aged among them to hide. I stood in a control room with a view of the rest of the Damar system. With big missiles, we'd shot down two other system corvettes that had raced from the middle asteroid belt to get here. I'd been right in taking the Star City first. After that, the rest of the system waited to see what would happen next. Rollo shoved the old Saurian. The creature stood at five and a half feet. His jaws were bigger than normal, and he had huge eyes. It gave him a wondering look, as if he was continually surprised. Instead of a uniform, he wore long, flowing robes that dragged against the decking. Are you a priest? I asked. I am the wisdom of the family, the old Saurian told me. What does that mean? He blinked his big eyes as if wondering about answering. Finally, he said, I decide on the code of behavior for the Damar system. You're the one who officially surrendered to me? I asked. This time he closed his big eyes. I don't think he liked the question. When he opened them again, he must have decided he had to warn me. A jelk will remember you, the old Saurian said. Of that I have no doubt. Do you know who I am? A destroyer, the wisdom said. A creature vomited from the cosmos to plague the family and their masters. There you go, I said. You have it all figured out. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to leave you your lives. I'm not half the destroyer you and your ilk were to us. He held his forked tongue as he watched me with his wondering eyes. Where did the Tenth Saurian Task Force go? I asked. The wisdom waved a clawed hand as if to indicate into the distance. How about you be a little more specific? I said. The Masters summoned the warships. Sure, but where? Away from the frontier, the Wisdom said. Now nah, we're getting somewhere. How far away did they go? This is wrong, he told me. You cannot expect me to reveal the workings of the Masters. I am loyal to the Corporation. I unslung the Banku from my shoulder. You're making a category error, old son. I don't give a fig about your loyalty. What I'm going to do is ask you again. I put the tip of the laser rifle under his jaws. If you fail to answer, I'm going to sizzle your head clean off your sorry shoulders. Then I'm going to bring the next highest-ranked Saurian in here. He or she will first examine your corpse. Then I'll see if they want to tell me what I'm asking. You lack decorum, the wisdom said. Yeah, what are you going to do, huh? It's a birth defect I've carried with me my whole life. You have three seconds to start explaining. Then...
your turn at life is over. He took two of those seconds to think about it. At the third, he said, The tenth left to join the Jelk Grand Fleet. They speed for the inner core. Why build a grand fleet there? I asked. To repel the invaders, the wisdom said, watching me with his wondering eyes. So Dr. Sant had spoken the truth. The rumors were true. I wondered again if my dream about Abaddon meant anything. But how could it? What is the nature of these invaders? I asked. I do not know. Who does know? I asked. The Jelk, he said. I studied the robe-wearing Saurian, finally deciding he told the truth. Well, well, well. The Jelk had truly stripped the frontier of warships after all, building the mother of all fleets in the core worlds. Who were the invaders? I shrugged and said, Take him away. Wait, the Saurian said. Did you speak the truth earlier? Will you leave us our lives? If you follow my orders, Pops, yeah, you'll live. He folded his clawed hands, and those wide eyes became half-lidded. He looked like a Saurian Buddha, then. The lizard even managed to half-bow. I go, he said, and you will go. May our paths never cross again. Sounds good to me, I said. We left the Star City three hours later. To ensure their good behavior, and from those in the rest of the system, we left seven floating missiles as active drones. I radioed the Wisdom and told him the missiles would attack whatever moved. It would be best to let whoever entered the system next deal with the waiting drones. Afterward, with the Aristotle leading the pack, we entered the jump gate, heading home. Given what happened later, I should have made different plans. Chapter 11 When we returned to the solar system, I felt like Sir Francis Drake. I knew a little about the famous sailor who had gone against the Spanish Armada. Drake had plagued the Spanish main in the Caribbean Sea, raiding settlements as he sought the gold of the Incas. During his trip around the world, he passed through the Strait of Magellan, a horrendous passage between South America and Antarctica. That put him on the western shore of South America. His ship, the Golden Hind, had been the biggest and baddest cannon-armed vessel, allowing him to raid the Spanish settlements at will. At first they had no idea an Englishman had made it onto that side of the world. By the time they understood, he was gone. Drake packed his galleon with loot and set out across the Pacific Ocean. The return to England proved to be a harrowing voyage. Most of the crew died of scurvy, a vitamin C deficiency. When he sailed into Plymouth, he met cheering crowds. His investors were rich from his plunder, and Queen Elizabeth had taken her share, too. It was like that, only better, when we returned with our haulers, mining equipment, and armaments. The next few days proved sharp with haggling. Diana demanded more as her share. I gave her less, keeping two of the haulers for the Star Vikings. One of those vessels I proceeded to sink into the poisoned Caspian Sea. The other kept watch near Ceres as we unloaded the last missile launchers and beam cannons onto the asteroid. Maybe I should have turned around fast and gone on another Star Viking raid. One thing after another kept popping up, though, needing my attention. Three months and four days after returning from our raid, Admiral Saris reappeared in the solar system. That changed the equation in a way I hadn't foreseen. It happened like this. Dimitri roved the jump gates. Sometimes he used the Pluto gate. Other times he went through the Neptune route. I wanted more advance notice of approaching aliens. This seemed like the best way to get it. Sure, it used up fuel and put a strain on the starship, but we had spare parts now and extra fuel coming from our scoop floating in Jupiter. The Jupiter scoop was nothing more than sturdy balloons floating in the higher atmosphere. 
There, the processor dangling under the inflatables collected rare deuterium swirling here and there in the clouds. When the time came, a booster launched a filled cell, which arrived at a container tube 50,000 kilometers from the gas giant. It felt as if we were getting somewhere. Given enough time, who knows what we might have achieved. The aliens never wanted to give us that time, though. The Lohars were the worst culprits in that regard. This time it was no different. At least it wasn't another triad of Shi Feng. I wondered if they still thought about me. I certainly thought about them and their so-called holy order. I remember exercising in the Aristotle's gym with Rollo. We did bench presses. My best friend had become a monster. Before the coming of the aliens, he'd been lanky, and I'd always been the stronger one between us. Now, not so much. As I spotted, Rollo breathed heavily as he lay on the bench. He reached up with his paws, the palms covered with chalk dust. He tested his grip several times, finally settling into the right spot. Then he braced himself while taking a deep breath. With a grunt, he shoved up as I helped him lift the bar off the rack. As he lay there on the bench, the crazy man balanced one thousand pounds on the bar. This would be a new max for him. With an intake of air, he lowered the bar so it touched his muscled pectorals. Then Rollo strained, his face turning red. He actually raised the weight. I watched, spellbound. My best had been 750 pounds, and I'd considered myself Hercules because of it. To my amazement, Rollo shoved the 1,000-pound barbell up to the rack, slamming the metal into the slots. Then his arms collapsed, and he lay there on the bench breathing hard and grinning like an idiot. The intercom buzzed. What now? I asked. Stepping to the intercom, pressing the button, I said, Creed here. Commander, Ella said. You'd better get to the bridge. I heard the fear in her voice. Is something wrong? I asked. Dimitri just came through the Pluto gate, Ella said. He said the entire Lohar fleet is heading our way. What? I asked. You're kidding, right? How many ships does he mean? Dimitri said he stopped counting at 300. That was a little over half in his estimation. A cold feeling erupted in my chest. Is he counting space fighters? Cruiser class are bigger, Commander, Ella said. We have a situation on our hands. Yeah, I said. I'll be there in a minute. I clicked off the intercom. Trouble? asked Rollo. He sat up, mopping his sweaty face with a towel. Looks like it's hitting the fan, I said. And the Lohars want to stop here before they go do whatever it is they planned. What's that mean? he asked. I regarded Rollo. I think we're going to find out. I figured I should do something with Dimitri's heads up. Clearly we couldn't face hundreds of Lohar capital ships. Why would the Tigers come to the solar system with an armada? Did they mean to annihilate us? Remembering the Shi Feng, I thought, maybe. Anyway, I ordered the Thomas Aquinas to Earth. Through autopilot, Rollo sank it deep into Lake Erie. As Dimitri raced from Pluto to Ceres, I gathered my two cruisers. As fast as we could, I had people cart out missile launchers and beam cannons off the big asteroid. I had them bury the ordnance on smaller asteroids. I didn't want the Lohars to know we'd raided a Jelk Corporation star system. Why would the Tigers care? Good question. They were aliens, and they were coming with far too many starships. Maybe they were here to steal our artifact. The days lengthened, and finally the first Lohar cruisers and battleships appeared through the Pluto jump gate. They radioed with a special system, telling us Admiral Saris of Purple Tamika came to inspect our Sol object. She'd been here more than seven years ago when I'd returned from hyperspace. In fact, she'd traded us our three cruisers. I asked her what she wanted. She smiled and requested a face-to-face -face meeting in four days. What could I do? I said, yes, it will be my honor. From the bridge of the Aristotle, Ella counted their warships as the mass swarmed toward the forerunner artifact. 
Five hundred and sixty-four purple Tamika vessels moved toward us. The Armada had six times the mass of the Starkian fleet that had been here before. There were cruisers, battleships, carriers, and missile ships in abundance. Clearly we were fleas compared to the elephant. The bulk of the purple Tamika Armada took up station near Jupiter. Fifty battleships came on toward Ceres. I had Diana and the rest of the Earth fleet stay near the freighters. Thus I waited near Ceres with two former Lohar cruisers. Finally the fifty battleships braked nearby, stopping. The Admiral requested my presence aboard her flagship. I went alone with my trusty forty-four beside me. The idea of coming by my lonesome was to shame them, and in a sense give them a subtle insult. Saris was the great Admiral. I was Commander Creed, and I walked alone. What do you want to hear? I docked my shuttle, walked corridors lined with hundreds of tigers in powered armor. Each held a rifle at port arms and stared with obvious hostility. Finally, I reached a hatch where the biggest tigers I'd ever seen waited. Without a word, the smaller of the two opened the way. I walked through. Two hundred lohars waited for me inside. Most had lined up against the bulkheads. They all wore fancy uniforms with lots of purple, golden braid, and medals. A big conference table was in the center of the chamber. Around it sat thirty tigers. Most were fleet officers, with a few robed adepts and some infantry generals. At the head of the table sat Admiral Saris. She was tall for a lohar, and she sat as if someone had surgically inserted a steel rod into her spine. I only recognized one other tiger. He was a bluff combat officer with a white nebula with purple trim pinned to his jacket. I'd seen him seven years ago. Halting before I reached the table, I bowed at the waist. There was a stir among the Lohars, whispering. Finally, Admiral Saris spoke. Where is the rest of your entourage? I came alone, I said loudly. That brought more whispering. The admiral frowned at the combat officer beside her. Good, I'd upset them. Their armada upset me. I knew it couldn't be good for us. Very well, Admiral Saris said. You will sit here near me, she said, pointing at an empty chair. Thank you, I said. First, though, you will give up your sidearm. They must have heard what I'd done to the emperor's daughter-wife, Princess Ni. Nee. I dearly hoped the big dog hadn't come along and just waited for me to be disarmed before he made his appearance. I handed over the magnum. Then, as if heading for a gallows, I walked toward my spot beside the admiral and came across the combat officer. After I sat, the admiral offered me refreshments. I nibbled on some lohar jerky and took a shot of tiger liquor. It exploded in my belly, spreading warmth. After I wiped my hands on a napkin, I figured it was time to get started. I didn't really care to have all these tigers watching me. Maybe I should have brought someone else along. It's hard being alone. I have to admit, I said, I didn't expect to see you in our solar system so soon. Those are my feelings as well, Saris said. The Emperor as well, I take it? He is, Saris said. I'm sure it would make him glad to know you care about his welfare. We owe much to the Emperor, I said, meaning that someday I'd like to slit his throat and watch him bleed to death. I wondered what would happen if I mentioned the Shi Feng. Nothing good for me was the likely answer. Sara showed me her teeth in what might have been a smile. I'd never seen the lady do that before. She had to be the gravest tiger I knew. This is not a pleasure call, she informed me. I didn't think so. This is a functional war fleet. I hope you're not here to wage war against us. Saris looked around as if surprised. The room erupted with tiger laughter. I wondered if this was what a gazelle might feel surrounded by snarling lions. No, no, the admiral finally said. We are neither at war with you guardians nor with the humans. 
Are you surprised at my distinction between the two groups? Not really, I said. The Emperor and his advisors view the humans as beasts, Admiral Saris informed me. You are something different, something higher on the evolutionary scale. Is that supposed to make me grateful? Yes, she said flatly. Okay, then. Thanks. Admiral, the combat officer said. You should not tolerate his sarcasm. You are wrong, General, Saris said. He has entered the hyperspace artifact. He spoke to the forerunner object and it told him its name. Halfway down the conference table, a robed adept rustled her garments. She had the most fur on her face of any lohar I'd ever seen. Maybe that meant she was old. I would hear the object's name, the ancient adept said in a quavering voice. In a minute, Saris said. She fixed her yellow orbs on me. Dr. Sant stayed here for many years, did he not? Was that what this was about? I cleared my throat, saying, The good doctor left some months ago. In an orange Tamika vessel, yes? Saris said. I think so. Why, is that important? The Admiral's eyes seemed to glitter with malice. There is evil in the space lanes, she declared. It came on an ill wind of fate. The old adept with her purple robe struggled to her feet. She was shorter than any lohar I'd seen and her head thrust forward. Trembling with age, she pointed a clawed finger at me. The ill wind came upon his return, the adept said. It came as he rode the artifact to the solar system. We must return the object to the Altair star system. It is blasphemy for it to reside in the abode of beasts. Your words are blasphemy, I said. The room grew deathly silent. The adept turned wild eyes onto me. She gnashed her teeth until foam flecked her mouth. Who are you to speak against an adept of the third degree? She asked in a quavering voice. I am Commander Creed, I said. I am he who closed the portal planet and halted the Kargs from invading our universe. Lies, the adept shouted. Yeah? I asked. What part specifically are you referring to? Lohars close the portal planet. This is a proven fact. You're dead wrong, I said. The adept turned to Admiral Saris. I claim... Silence, Saris snarled. No, the adept shouted in a reedy voice. Others around her took up her cry. Admiral Saris pressed a button and a loud klaxon blared. No one could speak until she removed her finger. Sit down, Saris said. I rule here. I will decide the agenda. The adept looked as if she wanted to argue. Finally, reluctantly, the trembling adept resumed her seat. The interchange so reminded me of Prince Venturi and his adept on the Indomitable that I wondered if this was some sort of ritual the Tigers went through during every big meeting. Commander Creed, Saris said, Orange Tamika has raised the flag of revolt against the Emperor. Did you know that was the Doctor's intent? I wondered about it, yeah, I said. You admit to this? Saris asked in wonder. I have nothing to hide. This is a grave breach of trust, Saris said. I don't see it that way, I said. Your lovely emperor caused my planet's destruction and billions of humans to die. I saved his bacon some time ago. To my way of thinking, he and you Lohars owe us big time. Once more, silence filled the chamber. You are not very diplomatic. Saris said. I figure you're going to do what you came here to do. It hardly matters what I say. Force him to tell us the artifact's name, 
the adept rasped from down the table. Yes, Saris said, staring at me. It is time for you to reveal the artifact's name. I made a show of looking around the room. The Lohar seemed to edge toward me, to wait expectantly for the great secret. They hungered for it. Settling back into my chair, I regarded the Admiral. Did any of the Shi Feng sit among them? I dearly wanted to know more about these holy assassins. Let's think about this for a minute, I said. Many years ago, the artifact fled the Altair star system. Listen to me, Saris said, interrupting. We are not here to relate old exploits. We know what happened at Altair and at the portal planet. It is inconceivable that a human knows the artifact's name. What makes it more galling is that no Lohar has shared such a profound knowledge with a forerunner object before. There are those among us who view this as a grave breach of protocol. Did she mean the Shi Feng? Hmm. Surrounded by all these tigers, with all these warships ready to attack the last humans, maybe I should speak delicately for once. Who am I to decide such things? I asked. I'm just a man, as you keep pointing out. If the artifact felt inclined to tell me and no one else, I'm going to keep it that way. You must tell us, Saris said. There was something new in her voice. It almost sounded whiny. Was the Admiral desperate? Maybe it was time to try a new tact. Once more I cleared my throat. Then I asked, Do you believe in the Creator? Lohars cowered and cried out, some shielding their eyes from me with their arms. I'm taking that as a yes, I said. If you wish to profane this ground, attempt to force me to speak. Otherwise, quit asking me because I'm not going to tell you. The artifact chose me. It didn't choose anyone else. That must mean something, right? Maybe it's even the creator's decision. My words made several adepts cringe. One tiger standing at the farthest wall watched me with hot eyes. He looked tense. I felt certain that Lohar belonged to the Shi Feng. I bet they're everywhere. Oh, by the way, I said, Dr. Sant dearly tried to learn the object's name as well. I didn't tell him either. The doctor claims you did tell him, Saris said. I don't believe you. Kill him, the adept screeched. Boil him in stem oil and eviscerate him. Silence, Saris told the adept, or I will have you removed from the chamber. The old adept breathed heavily and eyed me with wild eyes. Even so, she held her tongue. I glanced at the far wall. The tiger I'd seen earlier wasn't there. What did that mean? Look, I said, I think we should work together. We have been for some time, and it has been beneficial for both of us. What kind of alien is attacking the Jelk in the Core Worlds? Your only concern is in telling me the name of the Forerunner Artifact, Saris said. John F. Kennedy, I said promptly. A gasp went through the chamber. Tigers stared at one another in awed wonder. That is the Artifact's true name? Saris asked in a soft voice. I was tempted to say yes. Instead, I shook my head. Sorry, no. It's the name of a human leader. The wonder turned to outrage. He mocks us, the combat officer said. Let me kill him. His ways are profane, an insult to the Lohar race. Hey, I'm the object's guardian, I said. You need to start giving me some respect. I still haven't decided if I'm going to let you view the artifact or not. How can you stop us? Saris asked. That was the rub. I didn't have a powerful weapon. I needed one, all right. If I had the purple Lohar Armada, ah, uh, that would be something. Then things would be different around here. 
You do not yet understand your place in the scheme of existence, Saris informed me. Perhaps it is fortunate for you that I am about other matters at present. We came here for your cruisers and starships. You will return them to Purple Tamika. What are you talking about? I asked. The two cruisers facing us and the Earth Fleet warships. We're taking them back, Saris said. My gut tightened with rage. I had bought those with the most precious commodity in the universe, human lives. It took an act of will for me to refrain from launching myself at the Admiral. In a shaking voice, I said, We humans earned those warships with our blood. Times change, Saris said, pretending not to notice my anger. Unknown aliens appear to battle the Jelk Corporation. Can the Jelk stop these invaders? If not, the Emperor might have to do so with the might of the Lohar fleets. I, as the Emperor's representative, will ruthlessly put down the Orange Tamika Rebellion before that. Thus, I demand every warship I can lay my hands on. You have ten. This was a disaster. I had to use my wits and use them now. Despite the seething inside me, I said, Nine warships, not ten. What happened to the tenth vessel? Saris asked. I sent it out on a raid, I lied. The Tigers no longer deserved even an approximation of the truth. The cruiser never returned. Saris sat utterly still. Finally, she shrugged. I will take the nine. No, I said. How am I supposed to defend the Forerunner artifact without warships? When Saris didn't answer, I said, What if Baba Gobo shows up again and takes the object? Before that happens, Saris said, I have no doubt the object will disappear as it did before in the Altair system. It will not allow Starkians to hold it. How will the artifact know what's happening? I asked. You are a dense beast, the adept said. The artifact knows. Of that you should have no doubt. I sat stunned. Despite my efforts to use cunning, I found it too hard to concentrate. You're not taking our warships, I said. We'll fight to the death to hold them. Perhaps that is so, Commander Creed, Saris said. If that is true, then you will die, and all humanity will die with you. Is that worth a noble but futile gesture? I studied the Admiral as wheels turned in my mind. Finally, I concluded she was telling the truth. We'd have to give up our cruisers. That would leave us practically defenseless. Just when we'd begun as Star Vikings, Admiral Saris came and took all our dragon ships. Was this going to be the fatal handicap that ensured our extinction? If Baba Gobo returned too soon, or some other predator alien, then the answer would be yes. Instead of climbing out of the hole, Admiral Saris was putting us as deep down as humanity could go. Chapter 12 Several days later, after the Lohar Armada had left, Diana informed me that panic threatened the people packed in the Jelk freighters. As the vessels orbited Earth, there were riots, fights, and assassinations. I came to a hard conclusion and loaned her half the assault troopers. It was difficult to think of ourselves as Star Vikings now. In any case, in a Damar hauler, troopers from Mars base landed on freighters in Earth orbit, breaking heads as they helped restore order. The Purple Tamika Armada had left us defenseless, taking every warship they could lay their paws on. Fortunately, they hadn't taken any haulers, freighters, or hidden loot on the asteroids, nor did they hunt too diligently for the sunken cruiser and Damar hauler sitting down on Earth. What was one more cruiser to their mass, anyway? To us, the single warship might mean everything. I admit it. Depression hit me hard. A single alien pirate ship might annihilate humanity. We had to act fast. But what was the right decision? 
In our Damar hauler, I descended through the atmosphere toward Lake Erie. The Great Lakes looked normal from high orbit. No artificial lights shined up from the planet, though. Everything was dark, the way only North Korea used to be. Little had changed on Earth since the nukes and bio-terminator had hit. Winds howled, shoving multicolored clouds. It reminded me of oil slicks and puddles I'd played around in as a kid. N7 piloted us. I had a skeleton crew along. Most of the troopers were in the freighters, fighting under Rollo and Dimitri. During times of panic, a hard fist with shows of mercy to the defeated often helped quell rebellions the quickest. The hauler shook as greater winds struck our hull. There were no more trees on Earth, no more grass or lichen, moss or mushrooms. It was a dead world with quickly decomposing skeletons, rusted metal and crumbling brick and concrete structures. The Lohar decontamination ships had begun their work. After they left, though, the process of deatomization continued. Our automated factories worked slowly but relentlessly. It would take them more than a century to clean up the biohazard mess. Humanity needed something quicker. In any case, Lake Erie had the multicolored glare. It made me sick seeing it. I hated walking on Earth now. The bio-terminator was still strong in places. Four years ago, we'd lost 20,000 freighter people when someone with the Terminator bug returned to the living quarters up there. After that, Diana's people quit mining the Earth for old junk. It wasn't any wonder the Lohars hadn't looked too hard here for the missing cruiser. The Damar hauler shook as it touched down. N7 and I traded glances. I'll see you around, I said. This is wrong, Commander, N7 told me. Send someone else. No, this is my job. You are too important to lose, the android said. I laughed sourly. Right. I've brought humanity back to square one. Do me a favor, N7. Tell Rollo the artifact's name if I don't make it back. Promise me you'll do that. I give you my solemn oath, Commander. I will do so because you dared to risk taking androids from the Demar Star City. We shook hands. Then I headed for the hatch that would take me outside. In my pressurized suit, I walked on Earth. Despite the ruins around me, I felt as if I'd come home again. That was crazy, don't you think? I saw badly rusting cars, buildings looking as if hungry termites had been eating for a hundred years. The freeways were still intact. They were like the granddaddy of dinosaur bones laid in the earth. Nothing living grew up through them. I wondered if a thousand years from now the freeways would be all that was left of mankind's rule on earth. I have to change this. I have to make the earth green again. I want children to frolic under our sun. This sense of purpose steeled my heart for what was to come. I didn't have any right to be depressed. Someone had to drive ahead and make these aliens pay for what they had done to us. I reached Lake Erie's shoreline. The waves lapped on the lonely earth. I was the only living soul walking the planet. It made me shudder, and it almost brought tears to my eyes. I refused to give the aliens the pleasure. This was my planet, and they had destroyed it. Think, Creed. What are you missing? I could feel a hole in my head. No, not a literal hole. But there was something knocking around inside my noggin that I wasn't getting. It plagued me, demanding attention. Was it my subconscious? With a shrug, I began to wade out into the cold water. I wore a pressurized suit. Forcing my legs, I waited so the water reached my knees, my waist, and finally my chest. The harsh sound of my breathing was the only noise in my ears. Let's get this over with, I told myself. Water swirled before my eyes. Despite the queer colors in the water, it was clear down here. I could see easily, rainbows in the water as far as I could look. For the next hour, I tramped along the muddy bottom. 
All plant life down here had died. Mud swirled, and slowly it became darker. I would look up and see faintly colored light. At last, that stopped, and I moved within a world of eternal gloom. How deep had I come? I didn't have any instruments to measure that. Instead, I had a locating device. It beeped every minute. After two hours, a dot appeared on my HUD. That would be the Lohar cruiser hidden down here. Okay, here's what happened. I walked forever and reached the outer hull. I couldn't see a damned thing until I turned on my headlamp. It felt eerie as all get-out as the spotlight washed over a Lohar letter. If something had swum by me then, I'd have freaked out and raved. I didn't even have a spear gun, just a knife. Twenty minutes later, after marching around the craft, I found the hatch. Slowly, I rotated a wheel and tugged. Nothing happened. Had the deep pressure sealed this thing shut for the rest of my life, or was that rust doing its trick? Inside my helmet, which dripped with condensation, I snarled. I recalled Rollo and his one-thousand-pound bench press. It was time for Creed to play muscle man. I pulled harder, all to no avail. Maybe I should have sent someone else down here. Rollo, for instance. Nope, I'm doing this. The word sounded hollow to my ears. I put my feet up against the hull. I gripped the wheel and I began to pull. The hatch moved so very slowly. I wondered then how I'd prop it open. The frustration made me roar and I pulled it wider. Quickly I squirmed between the hatch and the hull. I forced myself through as the pressure of Lake Erie shoved the hatch against me. I bellowed in pain. If the hatch should breach my suit, I couldn't worry about it now. Water came gushing in with me. Then I slithered through. The hatch clanged shut and water came up to my chin. It was slow work, but I finally opened the inner hatch. The water gushed through with me into the warship's hull, but I was inside the cruiser with contaminated Lake Erie water. Sealing this area, I found my way to a decontamination area. After a long scrubbing, I shed my suit. Finally, I walked the lonely corridors of the starship. Outside were millions of tons of water pressing down against the hull. I turned on the engines, flicked on the gravity generators, and lifted the Lohar cruiser. An hour later, I parked the cruiser in orbit. We had our sole remaining warship. Later, I spoke with Rollo as we inspected the cruiser. The man might have looked like a muscle-bound idiot, but he was anything but. You know, I said as he ducked into engineering, we have a cruiser, as in one, to humanity's name. What do we do with it? It seems to me that sitting on our butts only means it's a matter of time before Baba Gobo or someone like him comes around to kill or enslave humanity, Rollo said. So, I asked. So we must go on more Star Viking raids and rebuild, Rollo said. Nothing else makes sense to me. If we take the cruiser, that leaves nothing behind to protect the freighters, I said. Well, the freighters do have their mobility, Rollo said. They can run away. That's one possibility, I suppose. We also have a few missile launchers and ground-based laser cannons we took from Damar, Rollo said. We can fortify an asteroid or two so they can defend against pirates. We could set up the weapons systems like German 88s, as Rommel did in the North African deserts during World War II. The freighters race for safety to the laser cannons, and bam! The rays take out any following pirates. I like it, I said. Yeah, I think you're right. We have to keep raiding. We have to build up to the best of our ability. It's a long shot. But ever since the aliens showed up on our doorstep, this has been a crapshoot. It's surprising we've managed to keep the remnant alive for as long as we have. I'd agree to that, Rollo said. Right, I said. It's time to get to work. Nine days later, we were almost ready to leave the solar system in our cruiser. The freighter riots had ended. Most of the ringleaders found themselves in the brigs. Murad Bay spaced a few of them. 
I wished he hadn't done that. I would have taken the so-called troublemakers with me, if nothing else. We'd worked overtime getting ready. Ceres bristled with the Demar system weaponry we'd taken. It was a veritable space fortress now. After long days of work, Rollo, Dimitri, and I relaxed in a rec room aboard Glorious Hope. We'd rechristened the vessel with its new name. The three of us played pool on a regulation-sized table. The trick was to beat Dimitri, a real shark. The Cossack didn't spend long seconds eyeing the billiard balls, either. He would chalk the cue stick, step up to the table, and put his left hand on the green cloth. Then, as quick as you please, he readied the stick, slid it twice through his fingers, and whacked the cue ball. The targeted billiard sank like lead into a pocket. Once again, I didn't get a shot for an entire game. Instead, I watched Dimitri sink all of his balls and then the eight ball. He straightened with a grin. Another game? he asked. Frustrated, I handed my stick to Rollo. This time you're going down, the muscle man told our Cossack. Dimitri only grinned. With a crack, he split the balls, which expanded across the table. This time, none of them fell into a pocket. My turn, Rollo said. He proved the opposite of Dimitri, carefully lining up each shot. After a long study, he tipped the cue ball, which rolled and nudged a striped fellow, which ever so slowly rolled to a side pocket and fell in. Yes, Rollo said, shaking his stick. Look at him, Dimitri said with an indulgent smile. Taking just as long for his second shot, Rollo sank another billiard ball. Now you're showing real improvement, Dimitri said. Rollo threw the Cossack an evil grin, and he squinted, studying his next shot. He sank the third ball. Dimitri said nothing this time. In fact, Rollo sank five balls before missing his sixth shot. Fatal are thy mistakes, Dimitri said. Rollo quietly stepped back, no doubt seething inside but calm outwardly. Dimitri sank everything, including the eight ball. Creed? he asked. I almost shook my head. Instead, I said, Yeah, one more time. Dimitri chalked his tip as I racked the balls. You know what I think sometimes? Our Cossack asked me. What's that? I asked, stepping away from the table. Why don't you use the Forerunner artifact as a ship? I hung the billiard rack onto its peg and turned around to stare at Dimitri. Do you remember how the artifact disappeared from the Altair star system? Dimitri asked. He walked to the end of the table, leaning down to take his shot. I said nothing. With the cue stick sliding between his fingers, Dimitri said, And how the artifact vanished from the portal planet with all of us hitching a ride on it? I still didn't say a word. Crack. Dimitri's break did better this time, sinking a striped and a solid. He lined up another solid, sinking it. As he moved around the table, examining the balls, the Cossack said, I've wondered why you don't go back into the artifact and talk to it. I mean, if it can teleport wherever it wants. Crack. Another solid went down into a pocket. Why not convince the artifact to pop around the galaxy for us? Can you imagine what kind of Viking ship the object would make? Dimitri straightened, glancing my way. He frowned. Creed, you okay? Rollo had been looking at something on a computer pad. He looked up, too. By the frown on his face, it appeared as if Rollo played back in his mind the Cossack's words. Suddenly, the muscle man glanced at me. That's brilliant, I whispered. Dimitri raised his eyebrows. You think so? I should have thought of it, I said. Yeah, the artifact just zipped away from the Altair system. It brought us home from hyperspace. I laughed and even to my own ears it sounded a little crazy. I thought the artifact has gone to sleep for twenty-five years, Rollo said. It's going to think things through. That's what it told us, I said. So how can you get it to talk to you? 
Rollo asked. That would be the first trick, I said. The second would be to convince it to move around for us. Are you serious? Dimitri asked. You really think that would be a good idea? I grinned from ear to ear. We're going to postpone our next venture. With a snap of my fingers, I said, I need to talk to N7. I put away my stick, heading for the hatch. Hey, Dimitri said. What about the game? I was too wound up to answer, beginning to run as I moved through the hatch. Chapter 13 N7 and I used thruster packs, flying from a Demar hauler to the giant artifact before us. As I've said before, the object looked like a gleaming silver donut the size of a medium asteroid with an artificial black hole in the center. Whatever anchored the black hole wasn't visible to the naked eye or to our scientific instruments. In my opinion, the technology of the first ones was in play. In most cases, their machinery baffled us. Who were the first ones, anyway? That's what I wanted to know. As the name implied, they were supposed to have been the first on the scene. The Tiger religion said the Creator sculpted the universe, first making the substance, of course. Then he poured the first ones down as a baker might dribble sugar into a cake mix. The forerunners, the first ones, made the artifacts, and in the course of time the living beings vanished. No one I'd spoken to had given me an explanation as to why the first ones went extinct. It was a fait accompli. The artifact makers were gone, but they had left behind their impressive machines and the jump lanes between the stars. The Jelk, the Tigers, and the Baboons all wanted the artifacts for themselves. Heck, even Abaddon had wanted them. Everybody did. N7 had been inside the artifact on the portal planet with me. Why shouldn't he join me a second time if it proved possible? Send a thief to catch a thief. Use an android to convince a living machine to help. The Forerunner artifact had told me its name before. Holgatha. Over seven years ago, N7 and I had been inside one of the squat buildings on the inner portion of the donut nearest the black hole. There, the artifact and I had engaged in an interesting conversation. As I jetted through space toward the approaching object, I recalled the words we'd spoken together while on the portal planet. Did the first one see the creator? I asked. Not to my knowledge, Holgatha replied. Is there a creator? N7 asked. Holgatha paused, finally saying, My designers and builders believed so. I have awaited the cycles and millennia for conclusive proof. Is that why you came here? I asked. I meant to the portal planet in hyperspace. I do not understand your reasoning, Holgatha said. Can you be more specific? Do you wish to unleash an apocalypse on our universe in order to see what will happen? I asked. Do you believe that will bring the Creator into sight? If Abaddon and the Kargs had reached our space-time continuum with all their moth ships, it would have meant death for everyone else. For the first time, I find your reasoning interesting. There was a pause before Holgatha added, I wonder if some of my oldest subroutines subscribe to such a notion. I will investigate. How long will that take? I asked. Do you mean in your time? asked Holgatha. Sure, I said. Twenty to twenty-five years, the artifact said. So your internal investigation is going to take quite a bit of your... Uh... I hesitated. Just how touchy was the artifact? I don't want to be imprecise, and I don't mean to demean you by implying you're a computer. But will your twenty-year analysis absorb the majority of your computational abilities? Eh? Holgatha asked. Did you ask another question? I have begun to assemble my Inquisitor files. I licked my lips. Interesting, interesting, Holgatha said. There is a new development occurring even now. My head twitched as N7 veered toward me in space. His silver faceplate stared at me. Is there a problem? I radioed N7. The artifact loomed before us while Ceres was a speck far behind. Negative, Commander, the android radioed. You seem distracted. 
I merely wondered if everything was well. I'm doing great. Now let's concentrate. We'll have to break soon so we can land. I used the familiar throttle controls. We wore ultra-vac suits, heavily shielded against radiation. We'd soon need every bit of armoring against the black hole. The trouble, as I saw it, would be waking Holgatha up to us. His subroutines were busy making his computations. What did an artifact of Holgatha's magnitude think about during his many millennia of existence? I couldn't comprehend. Then again, I didn't think I had to. Instead, I would use imagination. That was the great human gift, right? Today I'd have to employ it better than I ever had. Commander Creed, the man with the golden tongue. Yeah, right. I didn't see it, but I'd give it a go. It is time, Commander, N7 radioed. Twisting around so the nozzles pointed at the approaching surface, I engaged thrust. White hydrogen particles hissed from my pack. I began to slow down. The giant donut loomed even larger behind me. I could see it in my HUD. The last time I'd touched the ancient metal, I'd left the donut after having escaped a batten. The good news, Holgatha hadn't departed our solar system yet. We really had no idea how fussy the big thing would prove to be. In the Altair star system, the object had disappeared when the Starkians and we assault troopers had approached too closely during combat. I'd never thought to ask the artifact when I had the chance why he'd done that. Using even more thrust so my torso trembled, I lightly touched down onto the silver skin. Beside me, N7 did likewise. I shut off my thruster pack and began to undo the buckles and seals. Soon enough, I magnetized the propulsion system to the artifact. With magnetized boots, I tramped my way toward the curve that would take me to the inner portion of the donut. N7 moved in his lurching step beside me. Magnetized walking always took some getting used to. I saw a long trail of port exhaust up there in space. The hauler moved back from us. Turning, I waved to N7. He waved back. We wore ultra-dense vac suits, carried many days of air with us, concentrates and water and a special system that would help to eliminate wastes. The gear was good, but none of that would matter if we failed to find a way to wake Holgatha to us. Ready? I radioed N7. Let us proceed, the android said. It took a long time to walk around the curve, starting toward the black hole. Light couldn't penetrate it. A ball of deepest darkness hung there in the exact center. I shuddered and wondered how well the ultrasuit would protect my bones and tissues from the deadly rays. Strange script and golden letters highlighted the artifact's inner surface. Then I spied them again. The low buildings huddled together. While back on the portal planet, in the exact center of it to be precise, N7 and I had walked through the walls of one of the ancient buildings, bringing us to a place where Holgatha had communicated with us. I imagined for a moment that Holgatha wasn't a space artifact, but one of the creator's rings. Did a creator exit? Had aliens concocted the idea simply as a useless space religion? No. The artifact couldn't be a ring. Why would the squat buildings be there, then? Once again, N7 aimed his faceplate at me. I tried radio reception. All I heard was harsh static on my earphones. Making an exaggerated shrug, I continued toward the buildings. It's hard not to get loopy with odd feelings while trudging on Holgatha's inner surface. The artifact had been around longer than humanity had existed. Yet I walked along the surface. Beings called First Ones must have welded hull plates together. Could any of the builders have realized their machine would continue for such a vastly long age? It seemed doubtful. In time, the squat buildings loomed before N7 and me. The highest stood two stories tall. There was nothing grand about them. Together they looked little more than boxes of varying sizes shoved near each other. The streets were the same as the rest of the artifact's surface. The buildings were dark, looking like chalk. With my gauntlet I rapped against a wall. 
the side felt like metal. And Seven pointed at a particular wall. Chinning my headphones on again, all I heard was static. Here the black hole was our enemy. I turned my microphone on. Holgatha, I said. There is danger in the solar system. We request a quick council session to learn your wishes. Nothing happened. I banged the flat of my gloves against the wall. Once the gauntlets had sunken through, then I'd walked through a wall to the other side. It wasn't happening today. Could the artifact even hear my words? Something attacks the Jelk Corporation, I said into the microphone. The Jelk have summoned Saurian fleets from our frontier to help them closer to the center of the galaxy. The balance of power is shifting around us. We need some help. N7 faced me. I looked around. This was such a bleak place. I felt lonely and more than a little useless. What would budge the artifact? I had no idea. As I opened my mouth, I sensed a word in my mind. Go. Did Holgatha communicate with me in some strange manner I didn't understand? It seemed more than likely. Seconds later, N7 tugged at one of my arms. I glanced at him. The android pointed toward the nearest edge. I had the feeling N7 wanted to go. No, I said. I'm not leaving. N7 tugged harder. I disengaged my arm from his grip. The android's shoulders deflated. Holgatha, I shouted, slapping my palms against a wall. Go now while you are able. The artifact seemed to be able to put thoughts into my mind. Holgatha possessed super-advanced technology. Maybe telepathy was one of its forms. Stubbornly, I shook my head. The Shi Feng had tried to kill me. Dr. Sant had pumped me full of poison. The Starkians made a bid against us. And now the Purple Tamika Admiral Saris had taken all but one of my warships. I needed this ancient machine's cooperation. Holgatha, I radioed. You're in Earth space. We're down to one spaceship. I need to discuss your defensive situation with you. Fear hit me then. I cringed, wilting away from the building. A howl lodged in my throat. This was a terrible place. Ghosts must inhabit the artifact. What kind of fool had I been to return to this holy place? Even as I felt this, I realized Holgatha must be manufacturing the emotions. The artifact beamed the feelings at me. I refused to let them sway me. Forget it, bud, I said between clenched teeth. No machine was going to outmule me. I drew a sidearm, one gained during the battle on the portal planet. Aiming at the wall. Wait. I hesitated. Had that done the trick? On impulse, I put my free hand against the wall. It sank into the substance. A giddy sensation bloomed within my gut. Holstering the sidearm, I shoved my shoulder against the wall. Ever so slowly, I sank into it. Maybe I should have waited to see what N7 did. Instead, I pushed through the solid yet wavering wall. As if pushing against a raging stream, I fought my way through the material. A few moments later, I staggered through a small chamber. The walls gleamed white as brightness shined down from the ceiling. I didn't remember this place from last time. Then again, that had been over seven years ago. A second later, something staggered against me. I turned around and found N7 couched low. You may remove your helmets. The words sounded muffled. They came from the vibrations of the farthest wall. Like last time, I thought of the trick as a super larynx. Hesitantly, I reached up and twisted. With a click, I removed my helmet. Chemically harsh odors made my nose twitch and me to jerk. What is the problem? Holgatha asked. The odors in here are burning the inside of my nose. I half-choked in reply. A moment. The ancient artifact rumbled. There. Is that better? 
I sniffed experientially, expecting an even worse assault against my nostrils. Instead, a spicy scent made me sneeze. What is wrong now? Holgatha said in his deep voice, the wall continuing to vibrate. Nothing, I said. Don't mind me. On the contrary, the artifact said. You have allowed me nothing less than to mind you. I glanced at N7. The android had removed his helmet, holding it in the crook of his arm. He appeared calm. I knew better. Do you have a place to sit? I asked Holgatha. A stretching noise heralded substance oozing up from the floor. The sight increased the unreality of this place. The moment the substance stopped stretching, I sat. My knees had become weak. I realized we had gravity in the room. My magnetized boots no longer worked on this floor. That was interesting. Hurry, Holgatha said. Tell me why you found it necessary to aim a weapon at one of the monitor stations. Truthfully, I said, I aimed it out of frustration. Perhaps I also hoped it would get you to respond. I am busy in my analysis, Holgatha said. This talk wastes time, something I deplore. I'm with you there, I said. That's another reason I wanted to talk with you. You are tedious, Commander Creed. I prefer your companion N7. That doesn't surprise me, I said. Your inflection, Holgatha said. You mean to imply a joke with that comment, do you not? Maybe, I said. Explain your humor. N7 is a machine, you're a machine. For a time, Holgatha said nothing. You may have insulted him, N7 whispered. The android had quietly moved up behind me. That is impossible, Holgatha said. I have passed far beyond threats from such as you. I filed it away that Holgatha viewed insults as threats. Was that a glitch in his communication program or something more troublesome? If you're far beyond insults, I asked, why did you just stop talking a moment ago? I am busy in my analysis. Holgatha said. This conversation is a waste of time. He seemed to be speaking like a machine, with conversational limitations. I realized we knew precious little about Holgatha or any of the other artifacts. I'm afraid it could get much worse for you, I told the machine. Explain your statement. I told Holgatha about the Purple Tamika Armada taking nine of our warships, leaving us defenseless. I fail to perceive why any of that matters to me, the artifact said. There are several problems, I said, and they're interconnected. Before I can explain them, I have to know why you fled the Altair star system eight years ago. Fled implies fear, Holgatha said. I lack the sensation. You don't have emotions? Do I sensate like a biological creature? Holgatha asked. In no way is that accurate. I have sensation centers that compel me in one direction or another. To forestall another spate of simian questions, I will inform you that my present perception is one of curiosity. Concerning the Creator? I asked. Among other factors, yes, Holgatha said. And these curiosities are no doubt tied in with Abaddon and his cargs. That is incorrect. Oh? Did that mean my dream about Abaddon meant nothing? Would Holgatha automatically know if the cargs had invaded our space-time continuum? Uh, I said. I still don't understand why you left the Altair star system as the assault troopers and Starkians closed in upon you. Your implication is that I feared either species in some manner. To halt your chatter, I will inform you that I deplore Starkians. Do you have a reason? I asked. It would be a non-sequitur if I did not. What is the reason? I said. If you don't mind me asking. 
The wall that had vibrated grew still. Finally, Holgatha spoke once more. The Starkians failed in a sacred charge. Namely, an artifact in their possession perished. What happened? I asked. Just like humans, Holgatha said, Starkians have simian inquisitiveness. They swarmed their object, testing, probing, and questioning it. Finally, they tore into the subroutines and processing centers, attempting to understand Forerunner technology. In their quest, they destroyed what they did not understand. A machine of the ages perished while in their possession. A stellar-wide alarm pierced each of us. We understood. We altered our defenses, and we made the other races aware of the sacrilege. Since that moment, the Starkians have become outcasts to the noble races. The others scoured Starkian planets, turning them into smoking cinders. The last of the artifact destroyers took to the stars in their ships, a wandering remnant of those who would profane the works of the First Ones. You have a pretty high opinion of yourself, don't you? I asked. Holgatha said nothing. Perhaps we should leave, Commander, N7 said. I second the suggestion, Holgatha said. Leave before I eject you. Wait a minute, I said. No one here suggests we're going to try to probe you. One of the reasons I'm here is to tell you that the Starkians made a play for you in our solar system. You do realize that, don't you? Of course I am aware, Holgatha said. The Orange to Micah Lohar handled the situation in a salutary fashion. Dr. Sant has left the solar system, stirring up rebellion in the Lohar Empire. I'm wondering if a religious crusade has started in the Jade League. War brews everywhere, Holgatha said. That is one of the signs of an approaching apocalypse. That was ominous sounding. Concentrate on the issue, Creed. Don't let the artifact sidetrack you with rabbit holes. Right. I had to be like a pit bull, refusing to release my grip. Even so, the topic intrigued me enough to say, World War II didn't bring the end of Earth, I said. Your illusion escapes me, Holgatha said. Just because everyone goes mad with battle fury doesn't mean God is going to show up and end existence. It means everyone has lost his cool. Now the blood is going to flow. One of these times, it does mean the Creator will approach to judge existence, Holgatha said. That is one reason the Forerunners constructed us. You really believe that? I asked. I have no habit of lying, no programs to guide me in the dark art. I leave that to your kind, Commander Creed. The artifact's insult helped me clear my thoughts. I noticed the spicy scent had departed the room. In its place, I detected a faint body odor, my own leaking up from my suit. I sweated hard inside. First clearing my throat, I said, My point is the Starkians came to the solar system. They might have wiped us out before swarming onto you. I will not let Starkians swarm me. Holgatha said. I noticed his voice deepened as he spoke the words. You'd kill them? I asked. That is not my way. No, I would depart. But only after they wiped out humanity? I asked. Why would that make any difference to me? Don't you care if humanity is wiped out? No, Holgatha said. Many species have perished throughout the millennia. It is one of the natural processes of existence. I jumped up and began to pace within the small chamber. To give me room, N7 backed against a wall. Look, I said, let's make this mutual. You help us and we'll help you. How can you possibly help me? Holgatha asked. The lion shouldn't mock the mouse. Explain your reference. I stopped in front of the vibrating wall. 
A man named Aesop once told this old tale. A lion walked through the forest and happened to step on a mouse. The lion looked down and opened its jaw to devour the tiny beast. The mouse squeaked, Have mercy on me, O king. In time I will return you a favor. The lion laughed. What can a little mouse do for me? Some day, the mouse squeaked, you will find out. On a whim, the lion lifted its paw and watched the mouse scamper away. In the course of time, I said, the lion became ensnarled in a net. The king of beasts thrashed and struggled, all to no avail. As the moon rose and the lion waited for the hunter to come and kill him, a tiny mouse ran along the rope. I have come as I said I would, the mouse told the lion. You once showed mercy to me. Now I will help you. As the lion watched, the little mouse gnawed the rope. Before dawn appeared, the last rope fell away and the lion shook himself free. He thanked the mouse, glad he'd shown mercy when he'd had the chance. The tale is supposed to stir me, Holgatha asked. It should cause you to reflect, I said. In helping us survive, we might in some manner aid you in a time of need. How that would occur, I have no idea. As an extra benefit, if you aid us, you would also get to observe a desperate species taking on the entire galaxy. Do not strain my computational innocence, Holgatha said. You are too few to take on anyone. There you're wrong, I said. If you provide the motive power, we'll show you a spectacle such as none of you artifacts has ever witnessed. This is vain boasting, Holgatha said. You claim to have curiosity circuits, I said. In all your varied existence, don't you long for something new to see? There is nothing new under the stars, Holgatha told me, as if he spoke a maxim. Have you ever spoken to someone like me? I asked. Holgatha said nothing. Time lengthened. Finally, the artifact said, There was one like you long ago. It was during the last days of the first ones, just before their disappearance. His rashness changed the complexity of the galaxy, causing the terrible loss of the forerunners. He wondered if the Creator would appear to rectify the situation. During the next few centuries, we realized he had caused irreparable harm. Yes, I remember. He died brutally. Few mourned his passing. As I consider you, and given regular probabilities, you should have already died a vulgar death. I lead a charmed life, I said. I'm difficult to kill. I fail to see why that should be. And yet I'm here. I said. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. From the far wall, N7 attempted to gain my attention. I ignored the android. You have aroused a modicum of interest, Holgatha told me. What is your plan? I want to use you as a mobile platform, I said promptly. You'll appear inside a planet's atmosphere. From you, the assault troopers will launch their attack. If things go badly for us, you can simply transfer back to the solar system. What is this spectacle I'm supposed to see? Holgatha asked. A daring star viking raid, I said. What is that? Agree to this and see, I said. You won't regret it. Holgatha fell silent, no doubt computing. Finally, the artifact said, I see no benefit for myself. Worse, this will interrupt my investigation. Now you must leave. I have grown weary of your incessant chatter. Wait a minute, I said, casting about for an angle. You said there was one like me long ago. He changed many things, including the disappearance of the first ones. Maybe I'll also change many things, but this time it will be for the better. I find that doubtful. The evidence says you're wrong. Explain this, Holgatha said. We humans were instrumental at the portal planet. 
Our actions halted Abaddon's invasion, which would have been a monumental event in the galaxy. This is startling to me, Holgatha said. There is truth to what you say. Maybe humanity is the component the Forerunner artifacts need to shake things up. That shaking will bring about the appearance of the Creator. You spout sheer sophistry, Holgatha said. It is time for you to depart. Wait, I said. Let me finish. Nothing else has worked for you artifacts, right? I'm suggesting you try something new. I bet you've never been part of an assault before. That is true, Holgatha said. I have not. For this trial run, you'll play the part of a military machine. Look, we Earthers have hit rock bottom. My envisioned raid will give us the tools we need to stand up again. Consider what happened last time we had the means. I'm speaking about our assault at the portal planet. We kicked ass. You do realize that the Lohars fear us, right? Why otherwise did they strip us of our latest weaponry? The Jelk fear us? Abaddon and his cargs rue our existence. If we only had the means, which this single raid will give us, there is nothing we might not accomplish. I was stretching big time. But a sales pitch should be over the top. We needed this. Without a rich raid, I couldn't see how we'd build up in time to face the return of Baba Gobo, for instance. Never mind what else was coming our way. Yours is an interesting proposal, Holgatha said in what seemed to be a grudging manner. There is a unique aspect to your puny race. I am curious to see what your rash mind has conceived. It is fitting that I warn you, though. If I am destroyed, your race will be blotted from existence. You are aware of that, yes? I'm willing to roll the dice. Are you willing to try something new? I am intrigued enough for a single venture, Holgatha said. Afterward, I may well depart to a place far from you inquisitive humans. I find you to be an annoying race. I don't know who was more surprised at my success, N7 or me. We had a shot, and we had to make it count. That meant we'd better pick the right target. After that, we'd unleash ourselves against the galaxy. Okay, I said. You won't regret this. Turning to N7, I said, Let's go. We have a lot to do to get ready. Chapter 14 With Holgatha's provisional acceptance to try the plan, we no longer had to worry about slinking through the jump lanes in our lone vessel. We would move directly to target. That meant we could leave the cruiser in the solar system if we wanted. It was time to decide what and how to do this, exactly. I suggest we use every trooper we have for the raid, I told the others. We stood in the conference room on Mars base. A huge window showed the interior dome outside the chamber. Assault troopers jogged by in their zagoons across an asphalt running track. Rollo, Dimitri, Ella, N7, and I debated policy. We had drinks in our hands. Rollo sipped beer, Dimitri and Ella wine, while N7 held a bubbling mixture only an android could love. I cradled a shot glass with a splash of whiskey at the bottom. I figure it like this, I said, setting the glass on the table. We have to maximize the strike. Likely it's the only one where we'll have the artifact. Therefore, we should take every assault trooper, grab a horde of ships, and rush back with them to Earth. Then we can think about our next target. Shouldn't we leave a few assault troopers behind to garrison Mars base and our equipment on Ceres? asked Ella. Before I could answer, Dimitri said, Since the artifact is our transport, it seems senseless to fortify Ceres. There's nothing to guard out there anymore, at least while we're gone. Good point. I said. Where should we fortify? The only place that matters, Rollo said. Earth. And that means the moon. Take all the hardware at Ceres and set it up there. Let the Earth Council decide who runs it. Do the rest of you agree? I asked. 
The others nodded or murmured their assent. Okay, I said. Next order of business. What do we do with the glorious hope? Do we take it with us or leave it behind for the Earth Council? Better to take it with us, Dimitri said. Depends on where we're heading, Rollo said. If we perish, Ella said, wouldn't it be better for humanity to have at least one warship with its moon fortress? I'm inclined to agree with Ella, I said. What do you think, N7? What happens to the androids in storage? N7 asked. The ones we took from the Demar Star City? That was a good question. We hashed it out and decided to unpack them. They would help fortify the moon. We decided to hold off on making a decision about the cruiser. First, we'd have to know the target. That was going to take some thinking. Before that, we had to ready the solar system for our absence. Work revved up after the meeting. We hauled the defensive equipment from Ceres to the moon. Then we dismantled parts from Mars base. During our absence, humanity would porcupine around the mother planet. It was poisoned, but it was still home. I spoke to Diana and Murad Bey. With our coming absence, their power would increase, but so would their vulnerability. They asked questions. I supplied few answers. I wondered if the Shi Feng had sleepers among the last survivors in the freighters. Finally, we had to decide on the target. I secreted myself with N7, deciding to thrash it with the only person who knew more than I did about the region of space around us. N7 had begun existence as a Jelk mining android. When the assault troopers had been under Shah Cloth's employee, the Rumpelstiltskin devil had used androids as our drill instructors. Because of that, the N-series androids gained upgrades. N7 had proven better and more successful than his fellow machines, and he had consistently won more improvements. During the Sigma Draconis campaign, N7 decided to cast his lot with us. He helped us gain our freedom as we attacked Cloth's battle jumper. N7's memory cores never forgot anything. Even better, he could retrieve the memories. He did so now as we stood on Glorious Hope's bridge. You ask me where we should attack, N7 said. That depends on your requirements. That's simple, I said. I want warships. Better light arms for assault troopers, haulers to carry it back, anti-bio-terminator scrubbers, and better planetary missile and ground-based beam systems. One requirement makes the choice obvious, at least in one regard, N7 said. What would that be? I asked. For anti-bio-terminator scrubbers, you will have to attack a Lohar world. The Saurians lack such hardware, at least in any abundance. So be it, I said. N7 observed me. You do not mind declaring war against the Lohars. Who said anything about that? I just want to grab what I need. There's no declaration of war. The Lohars might view it differently. I'm thinking they have enough on their hands with a civil war brewing. Besides, how will they know it's been us? If we strike deeply enough, they'll absolutely know it couldn't have been humans who struck. N7 appeared dubious. Eventually, the other races will learn that an artifact aided humanity. I don't see why that's a given. We'll have to take great care after the assault. During the Vietnam War, the NVA soldiers usually dragged away their dead after a firefight. It made it seem as if the U.S. seldom slew that many. We'll expand upon the idea. N7 became thoughtful. That would imply you don't plan to leave any survivors to report on our attack. That was a good point. I molded over, finally saying, The Lohars nuked the Earth and sprayed the survivors with a bio-terminator. They started this. They can pay for it. I have no problem grabbing what we need from a Lohar world and ensuring no tigers survive the attack. In fact, the more I think about it, the better I like it. I was also thinking about the Shi Feng. They would be out there. Emotions are not the best guide in these matters, N7 told me. You're wrong, I said. The heart is everything. Without it, logic means nothing. 
You have to want something in order to fight for it, and that desire comes from in here, I said, tapping my chest. Perhaps you are right. In this area, I will not dispute you. Great, I said. Given our requirements, do you know which system we should raid? N7 turned toward the viewing port. In its reflection, I saw the android's eyelids fluttering. At last, N7 turned back to me. The Sanakat star system seems ideal for your needs, N7 said. It possesses a small world with vast abundance. There are many mineral asteroids in the system and heavy metal moons. Sanakat, the planet, is so small that many freighters land to load and unload cargo. My cores tell of surface shipyards building warships that would otherwise be constructed in space. Tell me more, I said. And Seven did. Afterward, I pondered the information. I needed a situation where I could employ the bio-suited assault troopers. I thought hard, finding difficulties in the location. Olgatha couldn't very well teleport onto the ground. The artifact would have to appear in the atmosphere. Getting everyone off the giant donut would be the problem. The assault troopers would have to jump, maybe use parachutes, parasails, or... I snapped my fingers and pointed at N7. I have it. I know how we're going to do this. I laughed as I envisioned the attack. It would be wild, woolly, and maybe the most exhilarating ride of my life. What is your idea? N7 asked. Do you remember the air cycles we carted from the Damar Star City? N7 froze a moment before nodding. Of course I recall. They are the DZ-9 air mobile attack cycle. The originator... Yeah, I said. I don't need those kinds of details. Tell me what they can do. I am not familiar with them in that aspect. Then it's time to become familiar. We'll test them on Mars. How many cycles will we use? N7 asked. All of them, I said. All? Yeah, that's right. Before I unpacked all the air cycles, I took several to Mars. A few trial runs showed a problem. After several passes, the fine sands of the Red Planet clogged the air intakes. This wasn't a desert flyer. Even so, the DZ-9 air mobile cycle was an interesting vehicle. The closest equivalent Earth craft would have been a bulked-up jet ski that was able to fly through the skies. Taking several to Earth, I did some trial runs. They flew well enough. The trouble was scrubbing everyone afterward. Finally, I took a few air cycles out to Titan with its molecular nitrogen atmosphere. That proved the right decision. N7 said Titan was closer in size to our targeted world than any other planetary body in the solar system. That was good to learn, as it would solve the biggest problem, how to get 4,000 assault troopers down to the surface in a hurry. The air cycles were big enough so troopers would double up on one. On Titan, we practiced dropping from a Damar hauler. With two troopers, their suits and equipment, that meant squeezing onto the seat. It also meant more than normal weight. With Titan's thin atmosphere, the loaded air cycles dropped fast. We lost seventeen of them to crashes. Five troopers died. I hated that. For two weeks, we practiced so we could get it right against the Lohars. Four Ming'ans of assault troopers were going to hit Sanakat. Likely that was too few. The small planet boasted big shipyards. That would mean protection, right? We don't have a choice in this, I said, bringing up a tough subject. We're going to have to deploy missiles from the artifact. We need to take out the areas too far to hit with our troopers. If you do that, N7 said, you're risking return fire. I realize that. What kind of warheads will we use? Rollo asked. Here it was, the tough choice. Thermonuclear, I said. Silence reigned. Ella grew pale. Creed. Stow your complaints, I said. We have to use nukes. We're too weak to play fancy. I stared into their eyes. Look, people, this is the big strike. We have to win huge this time. 
If we don't, it could be over for our race. The Lohars will retaliate against us, Ella said. I snorted. This is our retaliation for what they did to Earth. The Tiger Emperor has helped us since then, Ella said. Has he really? I asked. Who do you think sanctioned the Shi Feng attack in Wyoming? All indications show they are a holy order, Ella said. Holy my ass, I said. They're assassins. I bet they're tight with the Emperor. Besides, he reneged on his deal and took away our warships. I pounded the table with a fist. You'd better believe we're going to use thermonuclear weapons. We're smashing Sanakat flat and taking its goodies. Is that how old-time Vikings did it? Dimitri asked. We're star Vikings, Earth's last hope. Not only do we have to win, but we'd better do it so they don't know who hit them. That means we flatten their planetary defenses, strike, grab, get back up to the artifact, and disappear before the space assets arrive. That isn't going to give us much time, Ella said. No, it isn't, I agreed. I'm not sure this is the best idea, Ella said. Perhaps we should strike another Saurian-guarded star system. I stood up and walked to the viewing screen. With a click of a switch, I turned it to Olympus Mons. Fiddling with the controls, I scanned up to the top cone. The Lohars put their flag up there, I said. That's claiming territory. It may have a different purpose in Lohar culture, N7 said. I'm guessing you're wrong about that, I said. My point is that they came to our star system and planted their flag on our biggest mountain. Was that a Freudian slip? What does that mean? N7 asked. I ignored the android's question. Turning to the others, I said, Look at this another way. Dr. Sand has gone on a walking tour, spouting religious rebellion. It's frightened the Purple Tamika Emperor. He's gathered an armada, maybe to squash the rebellion. Our strike way out at Sanakat might aid Orange Tamika, and that could possibly aid us in the long run. How do you reason this? N7 asked. If we do this right, I said, Sant might point to Sanakat as the judgment of the Creator. Let's suppose a few tigers survive. They'll talk about an artifact appearing. The Lohars are crazy concerning the Forerunner objects. Many tigers swayed by Sant might view the attack as just desserts for the sins caused by the Purple Tamika Emperor. That's silly, Ella said. And it's really reaching. No, Rollo said. I think Creed has a point. You don't see that, Ella, because it doesn't mix with your worldview. The way a tiger looks at the universe, yes. The attack might help Sand's theological rebellion. If Lohar survive on Sanakat and report on an artifact, N7 said, that might give away our involvement. Surely the others would consider us the primary culprits. Yes, Ella said. They know Creed is unbalanced enough to attack them, and would suspect him of having suborned our artifact. He knows its name, after all, which they consider vital. For that reason alone, we must pick a different target. We went around and around with the debate. In the end, I put it to a vote. Ella turned her thumb down. She wanted to hit the Saurians again. We have a proven method for dealing with the lizards, she said. It worked last time. It's always best to use what has actually succeeded. Nope, Rollo said, aiming the open end of his beer bottle at her. I say we follow Creed. We're all free because he had the balls to try outlandish feats, beginning in Antarctica. I say we should hit Sanakat. The Tigers sent assassins at Creed, blowing themselves up to get him, Dimitri said. I think we should blow them up with thermonuclear weapons. I say we raid Sanakat for supplies and then stomp them flat afterward. We all turned to N7. I began as the commander's adversary, the android said. Since then, I have learned to marvel at his ploys. Let us attack Sanakat as he wishes. I faced Ella, raising an eyebrow. Yes, she said tiredly. 
Let's attack Sanakat. Your wish is my command, I said. In five days, seven at most, we strike back at the tigers. Chapter 15 It ended up taking thirteen days to coordinate everything. As D-Day approached, my fears increased. We were about to transfer hundreds of light years into a planet's atmosphere. I couldn't conceive the technology such an event would take. The coordination was beyond phenomenal. It was the next thing to supernatural. I wondered if I was getting religion. Wasn't that crazy? But a small part of me wondered about the ethics of using such a spectacular machine as Holgatha in such a bloody, murderous venture. Most of the time, endless work submerged my qualms. I preferred that to worried pondering. The rest of the days I used my imagination, stretching it to its utmost. N7 and Ella helped me. We had to envision the situation with gravity present. Holgatha would have to stay airborne. The day I'd spoken to him, he hadn't seemed concerned about the problem. I didn't know if that meant he hadn't considered the situation in detail or if he simply already knew what he needed to do. I'd find out on D-Day when everything was in place. The hour rapidly approached. Finally, the missiles, the planetary beam cannons, the air cycles, and a Damar hauler moved into position. In the asteroid belt, we unloaded everything but the hauler onto the artifact surface. The spaceship would remain in the vicinity. At Altair, we'd seen that everything in a nearby radius left with a transferring artifact. Once the hauler reached Sanakat with us, it would lift into a low planetary orbit, deploying drones to act as a temporary space force. It took hours arranging everyone in the proper location. Before I trudged off to speak with Holgatha again, I wanted to make certain everything was ready for battle conditions. We had a command center on Holgatha's surface. We had missile launchers to strike outlying areas on Sanakat and planetary beam cannons to hammer in a direct line of sight whatever would need it. Finally, we had Star Vikings. The former assault troopers wore their bio suits, shouldered their light arms, and waited beside the air cycles. With everyone waiting, I began the journey in my heavy vac suit. Walking alone, I headed for the curve that would bring me in sight of the black hole and then the small city on the inner circle. In time, I waited before the wall. Would Holgatha be too immersed in his computations to remember the plan? Would I have to go over everything again? No. I put my hand against the wall and it went through. A vast sense of relief swept over me. I laughed aloud in my helmet. Then I began the final trek to see Holgatha. Soon enough, I stood in the same white chamber as before. It felt different without N7. The fantastic age of Holgatha impinged upon my senses. Who was I to try to trick an ancient forerunner artifact? I felt like a bullfrog who had puffed himself up so large he might end up exploding. Why have you returned so soon? Holgatha asked in his deep voice. I stood holding my helmet. I tried not to think how easy it would be for the artifact to snuff out my life. I've gathered the troops, I said. A moment, the artifact said. Ah, I see. Time has elapsed since we last spoke. I reminded myself that Holgatha's perception of time was different from mine. Yes, I said, trying to sound more confident than I felt. The assault troopers are in position. You have other machinery on my surface areas. A few missile batteries, I said. They are of grossly inferior design compared to me. I do not want them on my surface lest some come to believe they are mine. As soon as we're at Sanakat, the majority of the hardware will leave. You will remove the inferior machinery off me at once, Holgatha said. I stood there blinking. We need the machines. That was not part of the bargain, Holgatha said. Why are you being so stubborn? I asked. Those items were implied. We're not like you, Holgatha. Humans need their tools to amplify their abilities. 
Inferior equipment breeds inferior results. The artifact boomed. Don't you think we know that? Not necessarily, the artifact said. That's why we're making this run in the first place. We need superior equipment. Why do you seek Lohar weapons, then? You should espouse for the best Jelk equipment. We've made our plans, I said. For us, they're quite elaborate tactical ideas. We've trained for Sanakat. Now, with the entirety of our equipment, we're hoping to get started. When? Now, I said. When did you think? I see. Very well, give me the galactic coordinates of your destination point. Closing my eyes in frustration, I realized I should have brought N7 along. The android waited at the command center. I wanted him ready to make decisions the instant we appeared in the planet's atmosphere. Are you familiar with the Sanakat star system? I asked. By the entomology, that sounds like a Lohar name. Right, I said. I am unfamiliar with Lohar galactic coordinates. Come on, I said. You're trying to stall. I thought your given word meant something. Holgatha does not stall, he said. You are besmirching my honor with such words. My facial skin turned cold with fear. I sensed his anger, and I didn't like it. What did I really know about the artifact? The answer was practically nothing. I hadn't expected a sense of advanced computer honor. You're taking my meaning wrong, I said. I have correctly analyzed your words. They have incensed me. You know, the trouble is I expected you to act like me. Me respond like an animal? Holgatha asked. There you go. I'm a biological being. Therefore, I expect sentient objects to act in a similar manner. Holgatha grew silent for a time. Finally, Yes, my memory files agree that many creatures act in the way you describe. I do not act in that manner, however. I am Holgatha, a thinking machine of the first ones. So what I'm suggesting is that you take the Lohar name and correlate it with your ancient star coordinate name. What does that have to do with your accusation of my stalling? Very little, I said. I'm trying to drop the subject because it has made you angry. I don't want to offend you. This is your attempt at an apology. I'm sorry I insulted you, I said. Just so you know, no one else has gotten that much from me. I accept your groveling, Holgatha said. I almost shook my head in annoyance. Instead, I sighed. Very well, let him think I'd been groveling. Let's just get started already. Where is the star system Sanakat? Holgatha asked me. I told him the best I could figure it. A moment while I correlate, he said. I waited twenty minutes, which surprised me at first. Then it made me nervous. I began to sweat. That made my symbiotic skin shift into light under the heavy vac suit. I have the old galactic charts, Holgatha said. My head snapped up and I chuckled nervously. His talking after being silent so long startled me. That's great to hear, I said. I cannot find the Sanakat star system, though. That's what the Lohars call it, I said. You should be able to find what the first ones named it. This time it took the artifact twenty seconds. You mean the star system? He gave it an unpronounceable name. During our attack on the portal planet, I'd had a chance to view what might have been first ones. They had looked like giant centipedes. I hadn't liked the thought of that at the time. Could what I'd seen have been a representation of a serpent? I knew which side snakes were supposed to be on, and it wasn't the side of the angels. Now, hearing the ancient, unpronounceable name, I shifted my shoulders uneasily. Where on the planet should we land? Holgatha asked. 
Not on the surface, I said. You're going to appear in the atmosphere. That is acceptable, the artifact said. Now give me the coordinates for the exact location on the planet. You're kidding me, Ryan. I don't have that kind of information. How will I know where to appear, then? And it struck me. I wondered how any of us had missed it. How indeed would a machine know where to transfer hundreds of light years away? Can you see where you're going before you move? I asked. Of course, Holgatha said. It would be foolish to travel in this manner otherwise. Can you show me a map of the planet as it is now? I can, Holgatha said. Right, I said. Let's do it then, and I can tell you. A minute later, I viewed Sanakat through Holgatha's screen. The world had green continents and big lakes, no oceans that I could see. I didn't ask him how he could scan this distance. Frankly, I doubted I would have understood the technology that did it. Since I saw the effect of the tech, I figured that was good enough. Can you give me a closer scrutiny? I asked. He did. I examined several cities and finally fixed upon a shipyard. There were tigers and machines everywhere. I counted the missile batteries and the orbital platforms, trying to memorize everything. Next time, if there was one, I'd bring in Seven along with me. Finally, I showed the artifact the spot to transfer. When do you wish to relocate? Holgatha asked. Can you give me an hour to leave here and reach my people on your surface? Yes, the artifact said. Well, that's it then. I'm going to leave. An hour after I exit the building, transfer to the atmosphere of Sanakat. When will you wish to return? I blinked several times. Why hadn't I thought of that before? Been too busy, I guess. I'll walk back here and tell you. And if you die on Sanakat? Holgatha asked. Then N7, Rollo, Dimitri, or Ella will come and ask you to return to the solar system. Noted and accepted, the artifact said. I will be observing your action on Sanakat. Afterward, I will make my decision whether I will remain among your savage species. Sure, I said. I look forward to your decision. We shall see, Holgatha said. Yeah, I said mainly so I'd get the last word instead of Holgatha. I reached the mobile command post on the surface of Holgatha. A thought kept troubling me. Would the artifact keep the right side up when he appeared in the atmosphere? Gravity would pull at us then. If the donut-shaped artifact transferred the wrong way, we'd all fall off onto Sanakat. That would end the Star Viking raid right there. For the next twenty-three minutes, I fretted over the problem. You should have set up a communication system with the artifact from here. Ella radioed me. I should have done many things differently. Thinking myself imaginative, I'd failed to consider too much. Humanity wouldn't survive on luck, although we needed it. Ella, I said. That was as far as I got. Space began to blur. At first, just the edges seemed fuzzy. Soon everything became blurry and indistinct. Then colors flowed out of the darkness of space. The pin-dot stars swirled, spinning faster and faster. I heard a garbled message in my headphones. Then sounds dwindled into nothing. The space merging became painful to look upon, so I closed my eyes. Vertigo hit me. Nausea caused stomach acid to burn the back of my throat. Last time, seven years ago, I'd blanked out as this happened. Now I fought to remain conscious. I wanted to man the guns right away on Sanakat. Around me, assault troopers began thudding onto the metal surface. Some of them thrashed about. What if the nuclear warheads went off accidentally? If they did, that would be game over. Since I'd be dead then, I wouldn't have to face the shame. So I quit worrying about it. At that point in my thinking, a yawning abyss seemed to grow before my strained senses. 
What mechanics did the artifact use to make the transfer? The first ones knew so much more than we did. What had made them so smart? Could the tigers be right about the beginning? Had a creator formed everything? Wouldn't those in the beginning be the best, with everything running down afterward? That was an old ontological argument, the wound-up clock. God set it up, all wound up, and since then the universe wound down toward entropy. Things went from extreme order to disorder, taking a long time to do it in. Ella didn't buy any of that. She believed random chance plus long time periods created order. At that moment, I didn't care. I hurt. My symbiotic suit squirmed. Then everything changed. Something dragged against me, pulling down, clawing at my atoms. Finally, I realized what had happened. I'd come to a place with gravity. I opened my eyes. I spied blue above, along with faint images of stars and two moons. Why am I seeing two moons? It troubled me for ten harrowing seconds. I began to panic. Then I realized we'd transferred, traveling hundreds of light years in the blink of an eye. Our asteroid-sized forerunner artifact hovered high in Sonicot's atmosphere. Chapter 16 Around me, a salt trooper stirred on the silvery surface. No, I told myself. We're star vikings. We have to think of this as gathering loot, not conquering an enemy. Ella, can you hear me? I said into my helmet microphone. When she didn't respond, I said, N7? Yes, Commander, the android said. Where are you? I asked, looking around. Air cycles lay clumped nearby with star vikings beginning to drag themselves to a sitting position. Farther away, large beam cannons aimed targeting apertures in various directions. Bigger generating systems hummed quietly beside them with thick cables linking the two. Beyond them, like waiting attack dogs, leaned the thermonuclear-tipped missiles. We'd literally packed tons of deadly ordnance in one small area. The only non-symbiotic-suited trooper raised his arm. He wore a cybersuit. It was similar to Lohar-powered armor. N7 would stay up here on the artifact at the mobile command center. Come here and give me a hand, I said. I want to pinpoint the outlying targets. The command center was composed of heavy tables with computers, targeting systems, and drone equipment. We sat under the open air with a few high clouds above. Far below, so everything merged together, was the Sonicot surface. It was bright green like a fairy tale with a ribbon river to the left. As others began to stir around me, N7 and I sat on swivel seats, tapping screens. Large winged drones buzzed with noise. The mini planes sped on the surface before lifting sharply. They had hypervelocity settings, but each needed a target before we engaged the high Mach speeds. Trying to remember what I'd seen inside Holgatha, I told N7 about the different Tiger defensive establishments. The two of us sat side by side. We played the part of drone pilots. Soon enough, our boards lit up. The sniffing drones picked up radiation and Lohar radar signals. Tap, tap, tap. One after another, the drones kicked into hypervelocity. They sped to check out the various military installations. Most of them were over the horizon. Sonicot had ten percent greater mass than Titan possessed. Saturn's moon had a diameter of 5,120 kilometers. It meant we were light and strong here, and that the horizon was much closer than it would be on Earth or even Mars. As the drones dwindled into dots and disappeared from my naked eyesight, I had time to ponder the situation. A monster asteroid had just appeared high in Sonicot's atmosphere. One would think such an occurrence would have freaked out everyone on the planet. I'm sure that's what happened. We must have achieved surprise, complete and total shock. How could it be otherwise? Giant metal donuts with artificial black holes don't just appear in skies. Yet here we hovered, bearing a brutal life lesson for the Lohars below. 
I believe we achieved bewildering surprise over the Lohars. It gave the assault troopers time to stir and gather their wits. As Star Vikings righted their air cycles, my first drone reached its destination. On my screen, I observed closed silos. No Tiger technician ran across the grounds. No Lohar cars screeched, sending up smoke. The place lay placid and serene. A glance at N7's screen showed me similar complacency. No, I take that back. As the android switched to another drone, I saw big circular plates in the ground dilate open. A focusing mirror rose to do battle against us. It's time to launch, boys and girls, I said. N7 glanced at me. Yeah, I said. I mean you and me, just boys this time. With quick, precise taps, N7 did the honors. Around us, the artifact trembled as two dozen missiles took flight. They roared with spewing fire, leaving thick, smoky trails in the sky. I had to close my mouth and let my eyes blink several times. The missiles gained velocity fast. Much quicker than the drones had done, the missiles dwindled out of sight. Get the beam cannons lined up, I shouted. We want to knock down all the defensive satellites upstairs. Others now began to sit down at their tables, adjusting computer screens. Chatter increased between them. The big focusing systems swiveled. Some aimed up. Others watched the horizon for Tiger attack craft. Soon stabbing rays reached up from Holgatha. I'd moved behind the new command team. On a screen, I watched a laser beam eat into an armored defensive satellite in orbit. The ray burned white-hot substance, turning the rest of the outpost into vapor. As predicted, Lohar satellite weapon systems had their cannons aimed into space, not down at the planet. Craning my neck, I watched the Damar hauler. Smoke poured from its exhaust ports. Flames flickered through it at times. The spaceship climbed for orbital space. There it would unload its missile drones. Their task was to knock down any approaching starships. We're doing it, I said. For the next few minutes I stood content. Rollo, Dimitri, and other commanders gathered their attack teams. On the radio nets they gave last-minute instructions. A woman cursed softly in horror. I looked up. Someone grabbed my biosuited triceps and pointed to the left. I saw what had made her curse. Checking a helmet chronometer, I realized that ten minutes after Holgatha's appearance in Sonicot's skies, the first thermonuclear warhead went off on the planet's surface. Given the mushroom's size, this one had to be fifty kilometers away. The cloud kept growing, rising and expanding as it radiated dirt. There wasn't anything pretty about this. Yet, in its own way, the atomic cloud had a horrible majesty. I saw another, a third, fourth, fifth. With an oath, I turned away from the explosions. We were doing to the Lohars what they had done to us. Part of me exuded savagery at the act, but another part felt small and dirty. Nuking planetary structures just seemed wrong. I wondered if I had let my hatred and my need get the better of me. First breathing deeply, I asked, Ella, N7, do you have everything under control? Affirmative, N7 said. Yes, Ella whispered. She stared into the distance at the biggest mushroom cloud. Don't look at them, I told her. She aimed her visor at me. We had to use them, I said. We have to knock out their retaliatory ability in order to win this fight. I know, she whispered. It doesn't mean I have to like it. I swallowed down a snappy retort. Maybe sticking to business was the best way to play this. Keep everything off our backs, I told her. I don't want any Lohar spacecraft, starfighters, or even balloons in the air. Knock down everything. We're going to hit the space yard. Ella's visor moved up and down in acknowledgement. Be careful, Crete. The tigers hate you. Some of them, at least, I said. There could be Shifeng on Sanakat. Thank you, Ella Timoshenko. Her words snapped me out of my brooding. 
We nuked them because we had no choice. This was their fault, not ours. I'm hoping there's some she Feng, I said. Spinning around, I sprinted for my air cycle. The time for contemplation and planning had passed. It was time to rock and roll. As if an internal switch had flipped, my outlook changed as I ran from the command center to my cycle. Worry about unleashing nuclear holocausts dwindled just as the drones had from my sight. I found myself grinning. Then I leapt onto my Saurian-built DZ-9 air cycle. Sometimes life could be glorious and sublime. A few, like me, rode alone without a back-sitting passenger. Twisting the throttle gave me power. With a hum of energy, I rose into the air. All around me, troopers lifted above Holgatha's gleaming surface. Over my headphones, I heard radio chatter, commands, and grid coordinates. I heard bubbling engines and saw airborne troopers bobbing several centimeters up and down. I gunned my machine, speeding away from the artifact. For a sick moment, fear curdled my gut. I zipped past the silver donut surface and hung over a vast abyss of air. Far below me spread out Sanakat's green surface. The fear evaporated as I shouted, Here we go! The sound reverberated inside my helmet. I loved it. Then, as if I were in the middle of a cartoon, my air cycle dropped. I plummeted toward destiny. Around me, other air cyclists dropped likewise. I could feel my lips stretch into a wild grin. This was too awesome. Today I had become Superman. Tilting my air cycle's nose downward, I gave it more power. I sped down for the space yard like a bullet. Whooping like a berserk hell's angel, I led the pack down upon the Lohars. This had to be the greatest moment of my life. We're the Star Vikings, baby, I shouted. We're here to rock your world and bust your balls. As my velocity built, my machine began to shake. I loved it. Hunkering lower, I sledded down like a madman. A quick twist of my head backward showed me a horde of Star Vikings hot-dogging it after me on their DZ-9 cycles. Maybe the Tigers had double-A guns and missiles. Stolen Saurian beam cannons lanced their rays down from Holgatha. They burned defensive equipment out of existence. I'll spare the sensitive and anti-poetic among you. Riding the air cycles, we swooped toward the space yard. It might have been a little after lunchtime, Sanakat time. Buildings soon came into focus. Smashed missiles and jumbo jet craft burned crazily on the ground. Most of them sent up thick, oily smoke. Things like bus-sized dune buggies raced away from the space yard. Other tigers sprinted for cover. A few took pot shots at us with hunting weapons. At that point, I don't know what everyone else did, but I can tell you how I enjoyed my visit over Sanakat. Rocketing like vengeance, I chased several dune buggy buses. They rocked up and down on the road and swayed side to side. The vehicles had some springs. The path looked like a steel highway. It reflected the harsh sunlight, forcing my visor to darken. In the nearest buggy, ten tigers turned around. A few pointed with their fingers. I couldn't tell if they'd exposed their claws. One cocked his arm and tossed what must have been a grenade. It exploded in the air before me, leaving a black mark. I dodged it just in case. Only two tigers seemed to have guns, and those were stubby like carbines. As I closed the distance, the carbines bucked upward. Did the tigers fire bullets? I couldn't see any laser or particle beam. With both hands on the bars, I swooped down after the bus like a hawk from hell. None of our air cycles boasted integral ordnance. These things were as innocent of weaponry as the first biplanes in World War I on Earth. Yet just like the first observers in those biplanes, I carried a handgun. Mine did not pop weak slugs. I had a heavy laser pistol specially selected for this. A coil linked the pistol to an energy pack strapped to the air cycle. Guiding the cycle one-handed, I drew smoothly. The tigers kept shooting. A bullet might have hit my cycle. It rocked. Another slug definitely struck my bio-armor. I felt a sting of pain in my side. 
Soothing coolness smothered the sensation almost instantly. I pulled the trigger. The beam lanced down, visible on my HUD. It rayed beside the buggy. As I closed the final distance, I adjusted. The beam cut down several tigers, including one of the rifle Lohars. My HUD schematics showed me the buggy's fuel pod. I held the ray there for two seconds. Then my cycle passed overhead by ten meters. Behind me, I heard a terrific explosion. I twisted around and had the distinct pleasure of watching the bus flip. Tigers spilled out, raining onto the road and the soft ground beside it. Then the buggy crashed, shedding metal. And it exploded again, flipping and twisting the thing. I turned forward, holding the air cycle's bars with both hands. The concussions from the bus made it a bumpy few seconds. After turning the DZ-9 around, heading back at the buggy pack, I found myself roaring with laughter. I'd been waiting to do something like this for a long time. I remembered seeing my dad, Mad Jack Creed, dying from a tiger beam. I remembered the cities of Earth igniting, including my hometown. I could also remember little penguins keeling over and spitting black gunk. The laughter changed to snarls of savagery. With each pass, I took out another dune buggy. Whoosh! I'd rush over the vehicles, beaming. Then I'd turn the handlebars, swinging around, heading back. Whoosh! Big old dune buses burned on the steel highway. Dead tigers bled. It had become their personal highway of death. The U.S. military had done the same thing to the soldiers of Saddam Hussein in 1991. Here on this alien world, we taught a few Lohars why their brethren shouldn't have nuked the earth. After the sixth pass, it finally dawned on me that I'd let my symbiotic suit get the better of me. For once, I'd gotten carried away with battle madness and bloodlust. It took a minute of intense internal dialogue to head for the space yard. Killing Lohars had its own appeal. Coming home victorious to earth trumped that. It was time for me to go tactical and remember the victory conditions. That was to bring home as many assault troopers as I could, along with prime loot. Killing tigers didn't count in that. Grabbing territory didn't matter at all either. But I needed to ensure we brought back as much stuff as possible. Turning the air cycle, I sped above the gunmetal-colored road. The space yard was in the distance. Behind me spread out a Lohar city. This one had tall steel towers like old science fiction posters. Big block buildings glittered with sunlight. I saw a Tiger air car take off one of those. It raced away. That didn't seem good, but I wasn't going to worry about it now. Facing forward, I saw Star Viking cycles dipping and darting above the space yard. As I neared, I heard Tiger roars, screams of agony, and machine gun chatter. An air cycle broke apart, its two riders falling a hundred meters, no doubt to their deaths. The high-pitched whine of lasers focused my vision. I saw bright rays stabbing down from the back riders. Tigers curled on the ground like bugs burning beneath a child's magnifying glass on a hot August day. The heavy machine gun quit firing. Then it started up again. Other Star Vikings killed those Lohars, too. A new squadron of cycles from Holgatha roared toward an empty tarmac. Rollo shouted orders. I heard them on my headphones. The space yard had big skeleton girders. Inside most of those cradles sat spaceships. A few were mere skeletons themselves. Other half-completed jobs showed pleasure yachts and military patrol craft. Several big warships looked finished to my eye. Seeing them made me grin. Then one of those ignited. Geysers of metal and electrical wires fountained into the air. Tigers raced away from the damage. Sabotage. They wrecked the warship. I gunned my cycle, heading for the other completed cruisers and missile ships. We needed those, all of them we could grab. I landed hard, running before my cycle had quit humming. Yelling at an Arbon of troopers to follow me, I began hunting for saboteurs. We flushed three Lohars trying to plant a bomb on the side of a cruiser. 
As we approached, one of them leapt to his feet and raced nearer, igniting into a fireball, taking two Star Vikings with him. Get down! I shouted. The next Lohar sprinted at us. He moved fast with smooth rhythm. The rest of the Arbon reacted beautifully, hitting the deck. The second tiger exploded harmlessly. That left the last one. They were in triads, I thought to myself. These tigers were Shi Feng. The last Lohar's gaze locked with mine. He began to squint, which I recalled was the firing mechanism. I beamed him in the head. To the side, it turned out. Yeah, I should have hit the ground like the other troopers. Instead, I waited for the explosion. It didn't come. The tiger slumped onto the ground and didn't ignite. Had my headshot shorted whatever mechanism made him blow up? I debated beaming his body into a crisp. We couldn't take chances with the Shi Feng. Then I reconsidered. I'd like to get my hands on one of the holy Lohar warriors. Get up, I told the troopers. Back away from his body. Sir? Their leader said, a woman named Zoe Artemis. You should back up, too. We can't afford to lose you. I have to check something. Zoe glanced at the remaining Arbon of troopers. Something passed between them. They rushed me. What are you doing? I shouted as they grabbed my arms. They dragged me farther from the downed tiger. Smoke trickled from his wounded head. What we should do, sir, Zoe said, answering my question. We're keeping you out of danger. Henry, check the tiger. I struggled, but there were several of them and only one of me. I just want to know if he's still alive, I said. Gingerly, the selected trooper bent over the obvious Shi Feng Lohar. He's still breathing, Henry said. Zoe aimed her silver visor at me. What should we do with him, sir? I thought fast. Do you have any bomb detectors? Yes, sir, she said. Check the tiger for explosives. Where does he carry them? she asked. In his body is my guess. Zoe stared at me a moment later. Then she snapped her head around, facing the trooper. Henry, she said. Back away from the tiger. He did, fast. Soon, with the others still holding my arm, Zoe approached the unconscious tiger. The Lohar had a hole in his head that leaked blood onto the tarmac. Zoe had a box-like device aimed at the Shi Feng. She adjusted dials and turned to us. He's definitely got explosives in him, she reported. Can you remove them? I asked. Are you kidding me? Zoe asked. According to this, she raised the detector. The junk is in his stomach. I realize that. Can you take it out of him? Zoe didn't stare as long this time. There's only one way to find out, Commander. He might blow up if you try, I said. Let me do it. She motioned to her troopers. They dragged me farther away. With her banku, Zoe Artemis beamed the tiger's stomach, slicing open his stomach with a deft touch. Then she knelt and reached in with a bio-suited hand. A second later, she yanked out a bomb with bloody wires. Cocking her arm, she hurled the warhead doing it none too soon. With a terrific blast, the bomb exploded in midair. A zagoon of troopers turned and stared. Zoe re-aimed her detector at the Lohar. He's clean now, sir, she said. Her head jerked. It must have been a signal. The four troopers released me. I hurried to the tiger. No hard feelings, sir, Zoe told me. We were just following orders. I said nothing. Instead, kneeling beside the diffused Chi Feng, I took out a medikit. With it, I began to patch him the best I could. Are you trying to keep him alive, sir? Zoe asked behind my back. As of now, I said, your task is to bring the tiger back alive. I want him upstairs with us when we leave. Zoe aimed her visor at the sky. I stood, looking up, too. The vast silver donut gleamed up there. It seemed obscene somehow.
and it struck me as very like the science fiction stories I'd read in my youth. Is he important, sir? Zoe asked. I don't know. It's possible. She nodded, motioning to her troopers. I could see that Zoe Artemis ran a tight ship. That was a good sign. Soldiers like her were one of the reasons we'd won so many of our encounters. After watching Zoe and her Arbon hustle the unconscious tiger to their cycles, I went back to mine. Lifting into the air, I searched for Rollo. It took me a few moments to find the right channel. He stood with a clod of Star Vikings near the biggest spaceship. I landed beside him. For the next few hours, Rollo and I toured one spaceship after another. Those we could take rose upstairs to Holgatha. The rest we rigged with explosives. At this point, I discovered a problem with using the artifact as the central attack platform. On Sanakat, Holgatha remained stationary. I would have liked to hit the opposite side of the planet and do the same thing there as we'd done here. From what I can tell, Rollo said, the outskirts of the city are where they keep the warehouses. I gazed at our new warships floating beside the artifact. The raid was supposed to be a rich one for us, the Big Daddy Payday. In World War II, at the start of the Pacific War for America and Japan, the enemy had struck at Pearl Harbor. Everyone knows the story. Japanese planes destroyed docked American capital ships and parked aircraft, although they missed the carriers. The U.S. flat tops had been out at sea on maneuvers. On the return to their own carriers, some of the Japanese pilots begged for one more strike. They wanted to hit the big oil tanks on shore and blow them up. The Japanese Admiral Nagumo wanted no part of that. He wished to bring the Japanese fleet home intact. They'd done enough. It was time to scram. So they sailed away, leaving the oil tanks intact. If they had made one more strike, it would have crippled American recovery efforts even further. Without those oil tanks in Hawaii, the American Navy would have had a much harder time striking the Japanese Empire as soon as it had. This was our Pearl Harbor. I had to grab as much ordnance as I could, not rush out too soon. Gather your troopers, I told Rollo. We're hitting the outskirts of the city. Chapter 17 from the space yard, we rose like a swarm of angry wasps. Gunning our DZ-9 air cycles, we sped for the city warehouses. As we approached, the Lohar urban area took on a more distinct shape. Some of the steel towers looked rusted, which seemed strange. I saw chips in the big block buildings. Had there been fighting here recently? A few tigers stood on the roofs with heavy machine guns and handheld RPGs. The rockets flew as slugs and beams struck us. They took out several cycles. Then we closed, slaughtering the Lohars on the roofs. We landed and killed every tiger we saw on the ground. It became a massacre. The warehouses stood several stories high. Each held military hardware, much more than we could carry away on our cycles. I made a call. Haulers rose from the space yard and landed here. On the double, troopers loaded the grounded spaceships. We packed the cargo holds, raced to the next warehouse, and emptied it as well. For me, time sped up. Several hours passed in a flash. There was so much to do and no time to do it. Then Tiger tanks rumbled out of the city. The cannons on Holgatha put on a laser light show, destroying them all. Death from above, baby. Later, power-armored tigers tried to surprise us, bounding like maddened grasshoppers, desperately trying to close. The artifact-perched lasers hit them, too. By that time, three captured Lohar pinnaces joined the fun. They slid above like air sharks. Particle beams destroyed tiger combat cars sweeping from the west. We were star vikings. We smashed the local tiger forces and filled up hauler after hauler. Each one rose up to Holgatha, waiting to leave. Those who remained on the surface went to another space yard fifty kilometers away. There we repeated the sequence. At that point, the resistance on Sanakat ended, although we didn't know it yet. Could we have looted the entire planet? It's possible. 
a surprise against us halted our operations. After a solid seven hours of fighting, looting, and laughing, I called up to N7. A soldier had told me they really wanted to speak with me. Commander Creed, where have you been? N7 asked. Just tell him, Ella said in the background. Tell me what? I asked. From where I stood, I watched troopers entering a hauler, stowing away hardware as if they were African army ants. We have to leave Sanakat, Commander, N7 said. A flotilla of Lohar warships is headed from the heavy metal moons toward us. They've already wiped out our space drones. The Demar hauler is heading back to Holt. N7 almost spoke the artifact's name. The hauler returns to... He probably realized he shouldn't call it the artifact either. Not if Lohars could hear him. I understand, I said. We must leave, Commander, N7 said. The approaching warships will have the high ground against us. We can send up five patrol boats, but we still haven't shaken down our cruisers and missile ships. If the enemy attacks us from orbital space... Okay, I said. Start packing. I'll talk to Rollo. We'll lift up to... the platform. I want you to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. Someone will have to go see our pilot, N7 said. Roger, I said. I'm coming upstairs. Our android meant I should go see Holgatha in the inner chamber. It was time to let my troopers finish their tasks and scram. Rollo and Dimitri could take care of things down here. I had to get the artifact ready to transfer back to the solar system before the dreaded Lohar cavalry arrived on the scene. My air cycle used the last of its power source to climb upstairs. Stolen Lohar cruisers, missile ships, and patrol boats hovered around the artifact. Seeing them made me feel good inside. From the direction of the faintly appearing stars, I saw the Damar hauler descending. What had N7 told me? The approaching Lohars had already destroyed the hauler's space drones. Yeah, it was time to go. I grounded the DZ-9 on Holgatha's metallic surface. Sprinting to a waiting locker, I threw it open. Yanking the heavy vac suit inside, I put it on. Afterward, I jumped onto the cycle again and floated toward the inner curve. Halfway there, the cycle shorted out. I would have to hoof it the rest of the way. After ten minutes of walking, my headphones crackled. I chinned a response. Commander, N7 said, I have a message from the Lohar Flotilla Admiral. Why would I care? I asked. He wishes to speak with you. He asked for you by name, Commander. Come on, N7, did you forget to turn off your video when you addressed him? I followed procedures, sir. He demanded to speak to Commander Creed. Do you personally know the Lohar Admiral? No, N7 said. All right, I said. Patch him through to my HUD. I trudged along Holgatha, using my magnetic boots at full strength. I didn't want to fall off. As I walked, the old tiger appeared on one half of my HUD. The other half let me see where I was going. The old guy had a wide face for a Lohar with too much white fur. This tiger had jowls like a bulldog. I'd never seen that before on one. I suspected he was fat. He wore a heavy purple garment with a fringed purple robe. His eyes were bright orange. I wondered if drugs had caused the color. Naturally, I kept my face from his sight. You wanted to talk to me, so talk, I said. Commander Creed, he asked in a rich voice. Don't know who that is, I said. But it's true, I lead the expedition. You are the one known as Creed, he said with finality. Is this Creed a legendary space pirate? I asked. The tiger snarled. It brightened his already orange eyes. It also made the white fur stand out. Do you not realize who you address? he asked. Nope, I said. Don't have any idea. I am the Emperor of the Lohar. Oh, I thought to myself. You've got to be kidding. I am Felix Rex Logos, he said. 
I have heard of you, savage. No, the Imperium of the Lohars shall hunt you down to the ends of the galaxy. There is no place you can hide. The worst part is that I bet you think that's an original threat, I said. He snarled again, spraying spit. Got a bit of an anger issue, do you? I said. You have bitten off more than you can swallow, beast. You have awakened my wrath against your species. Turn that around and you'll get some idea of how I feel about you, Mr. King, bro. I accept your declaration of war, Emperor Felix told me. Great, I said. I accept as well. Destroy these others you speak about as I laugh all the way to the bank. He leaned toward me with his eyes widening. You consider yourself clever by hiding your visage, beast. Yet I know it is you, Commander Creed. We have images of the Forerunner artifact in Sanakat's skies. All aboard my flagship know it as the Altair object. I know every mark on the holy relic. For a moment, I closed my eyes. I hadn't thought about that. I don't have any idea what you're talking about, King Bro, I said. He snarled a laugh. Do you not realize yet? Once, during the reign of my mother, I commanded the Lohar Fifth Legion as it guarded the holy artifact in the Altair star system. I scowled. If he'd led the Fifth Legion once... I served the artifact and gazed upon its beauty, the Emperor said. Many times I walked upon it as I considered the holiness of the Creator. You, beast, attacked the Fifth Legion. You and your Starkian scum used nuclear weapons to kill my brothers in arms. I know you, Creed Beast. In an arcane, vile fashion, you have suborned the noblest of the artifacts. It sickens me. Yet I have heard you know the relic's name. How this can be so is a mystery. But for your reckless killing on Sanakat... Hey, you know what, Mr. Big Shot? I said. Why don't you shut the hell up? You ordered my Earth destroyed. You tried to take humanity down. Yes. I knew from the beginning that you were savages beyond the pale of civilization. I indeed ordered your species' destruction. My only remorse was that some of you survived the attack. Orange Tamika has much to answer for in failing to do as I bid them. That's it, I said. By your own words, you've sealed your fate. No, you have sealed yours. I almost told him, no way, man, I said it first. But this wasn't a pissing contest. This was the game of races. As I trudged across Holgatha, I considered what the Felix Rex Logos Purple Tamika Emperor had just told me. He'd once been a legionary of the Fifth. I'd helped slaughter the Legion. He knew Holgatha by sight. Yeah, I could see this was bad. Instead of a Star Viking raid so humanity could grab some extra stuff, I just ensured we were in a war to the death with the largest battle fleet around. The Jelk didn't seem to be interested in this part of the Orion arm just now. They had their own problems. Instead of improving mankind's situation, I just made it a whole lot worse. Great. What are you doing in the Sonicot system anyway? I asked. Vain beast, I shall capture you. It was time to throw him a curveball. Are you going to do it with the Shi Feng? I asked. On my HUD, the Emperor recoiled. How have you come to learn the holy name? He asked in a higher voice. Secret secrets are no fun, I answered. Secret secrets hurt someone. He gnashed his teeth and sprayed more spit. No, you foul beast, that I shall begin a holy crusade against humanity. You will not be able to hide among the jelk. No, you cannot run far enough to escape my wrath. I will track you and slice your belly open myself. 
Then I shall pull out your intestines and feed on them to my court's delight. I'm not that fancy, King Bro. I'm just gonna blow your head clean off and piss down your neck. Enough, he roared. That's right, I said. I clicked off the connection. I'd had enough of his royal majesty. I stalked across Holgatha, getting angrier by the moment. This was just great. This... I had to warn the others. N7, I radioed. Static answered me. Our radio equipment didn't seem to be as good as what the Lohar Emperor possessed. I'd have to wait until I was farther away from the black hole to communicate with the others. Why was the Emperor in the Sanakat star system? I shook my head. It didn't matter how Felix Rex Logos had come to be here at this time. I wondered if Holgatha had known. Would the artifact even care? Maybe. I began to wonder why the artifact had agreed to my request to transfer to Sanakat. Had Holgatha computed the present situation between the Lohars and us? At this point, did he wish to see humanity gone forever? If true, that had ominous implications. Shaking my head, I realized I couldn't worry about any of that now. We needed to get out of here before the Tiger Flotilla reached its operational range. Surely they would have T-missiles. I increased my pace across Holgatha. An eternity later, I stood before the wall of the building. It looked different in daylight. I'd never realized before how pitted the surface was. Raising my right gauntlet, I curled the fingers, getting ready to strike the wall with my knuckles. You are ready to return to the solar system? Yes, I radioed. You do not need to come inside. Instead, return to your people. I will transfer in thirty of your minutes. How about doing it right now? I said. That would kill you. Knowing that, do you still wish for me to leave instantly? Can you sense the approaching Lohar ships? I am aware of them, of course. I have been the entire time. Can they attack us within thirty minutes' time? No. Then give us those thirty minutes to get out of the Black Hole's range. Goodbye, Commander Creed. Do not ever attempt to speak with me again. I find myself sullied by today's murders. Why would you care? It is the way of the universe, things dying out. You told me so yourself. Heed my words, Commander. I am sick of your voice, your thoughts, and your ways. Do not seek to speak with me again. I will finish my analysis in your solar system, then I will leave. That gives us eighteen more years, right? I asked. You are deluded. Your species does not even have three years left. The Purple Emperor will annihilate every human in existence before the Triple Years run their course. I didn't know what to say to my own private oracle preaching doom. So I turned around and headed back toward the outer surface. Thirty-nine and a half minutes later, the vertigo struck again. Everything blurred and the Forerunner artifact transferred from the atmosphere of Sanakat back to the middle of the asteroid belt. We returned to the solar system with our captured starships, patrol boats, missiles, container loads of small arms and bio-terminator scrubbers. The Star Viking raid proved a smashing tactical success and a bitter strategic loss. Now what were we going to do? Chapter 18 Due to our form of travel, we had some time to decide on our next maneuver. Felix Rex Logos, Purple Tamika Emperor, raced in a warship within the Sanakat star system. That happened to be 337 light years away from the solar system. Even with his fastest scouts, it would take time for the news to travel throughout the star lanes. Before we did anything, though, we needed to count losses and gains. The Star Viking raid onto Sanakat cost us 107 dead. The wounded hardly mattered because we could heal them back to full health in the Jelk tank. We lost a little over double that number in air cycles. The reward went beyond my fondest hopes. 
We reaped five patrol boats, four cruisers, and three missile ships, along with a good supply of missiles and planetary particle beam cannons. That didn't include a horde of small arms, mortars, and grenades. We had newer and more modern starships compared to the ones we'd lost. We also had patrol boats. They could enter a planetary atmosphere or race through the jump gates and watch. If I kept everything together in one group, humanity possessed a modest flotilla. True, it couldn't face Baba Gobo's fleet or Admiral Saris, but it was a beginning. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough assault troopers to man all the spacecraft and have a viable ground-fighting force. Therefore, I summoned Diana and Murad Bey to Mars base. They brought their sole cruiser together with an armed escort of bodyguards. The guards cooled their heels in a holding area under the dome, far away from the meeting chamber. In the conference room, Diana studied me, and Murad Bey tried to smile. He was a square-shouldered giant of a Turk. Even after eight years in power, he had the blackest hair I'd ever seen. These days I had the feeling he dyed it. Murad Bey combed the mass straight back. Plastic surgery had taken away an old burn scar on his neck. As the two Earth Council members listened, I gave them a rundown of the raid, including my conversation with the Emperor. Diana grew pale. Murad Bey's jaw muscles, the ones hinging them, bulged out and in. It is to be a war to the death. Murad Bey declared in his slow voice. No, Diana said. If the Lohar Emperor comes to Earth, it means extermination for us and nothing bad for them. By Allah, Murad Bey said, his dark eyes shining. It will not be so. I've said it before, and I think it bears repeating. The humans left were the tough, willing to scrap against anyone. It didn't matter from what race or religion our enemies came. The last one percent were the rawest sons and daughters of bitches our planet had ever borne. Do you have a plan? Diana asked me. Not yet, I admitted. The Amazon queen put her hands on the table, staring at me. Your madness gave us our chance. Now your insanity has taken it away again. We have options, I said. I would dearly like to hear them, Diana said. Standing, glancing at Ella, who pretended to take notes, I strode toward the viewing screen. It showed the asphalt of Mars Base, our empty sidewalks. Staring out of the viewing port, I said, First, we could do a Starkian. Leave our solar system? Diana asked. It is the optimal choice, I said. No. We need a home base, Diana said. You may have patterned your troopers off the Mongol nomads. The rest of us need a place to call home. Otherwise, we'll become demoralized. I do not know if I agree, Murad Bey said. The Prophet Muhammad journeyed from Mecca for a season. Perhaps we must emulate his example. My head snapped around. I'd been staring at Zoe Artemis as she walked on a sidewalk outside. What did you say? I asked Murad Bey. He had a wooden face with almost no expression. The skin looked leathery. In the beginning, the big man said, the people of Mecca did not believe the prophet's words. Thus he took his followers and traveled to Medina. There he gained more servants of Allah. With them he raided his accusers. Unable to bear this, the merchants of Mecca gathered an army to do war against them. Allah granted the pagan army into the hands of the true believers, giving them to Muhammad. The rest you know, as Islam spread throughout the world. The Amazon queen glanced from Murad Bey to me. What are you thinking, Creed? What? I asked, lost in thought again. I know that look, she said. You have an idea. You're not really considering following Muhammad's example, are you? Dr. Sant did, I said softly. Diana blinked those big eyelashes at me. Think about it a moment, I said. I know the artifact's name. 
I rode it from the portal planet to the solar system. Seven years later, I rode the artifact again. This time, I did it to chastise the Lohars. I did it in the system where the Purple Tamika Emperor happened to be. That was a coincidence, Diana said. Do you really believe that? I asked. Ella set down her stylus. She couldn't keep silent, but asked, Did the artifact tell you the Emperor would be there? The relic didn't have to, I said. The two women traded glances. Are you saying you planned this? Diana asked. I had to chuckle. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm talking strategy. Look, the Jelk Corporation is out of the present fight. That leaves the Jade League. Why did the various races form the League in the first place? To protect themselves from the Jelk, Diana said. That's right, I said. They also did it to protect the Forerunner relics. For most of them, the League has taken on religious significance. So? Diana asked. So we have to fight fire with fire, I said. The Purple Tamika Emperor told me he'd build a massive crusade against humanity. Well, we have to counter that. How do you battle an idea? With a better idea, Ella said. Exactly, I said, pointing at her. I don't think you've thought this through, Diana said. The aliens think we're beasts. They're not going to listen to you, a talking animal. They wouldn't even let the Forerunner Guardians join the Jade League. Yes. I said with a laugh. Don't you see? That's why the artifact acted on our behalf. The relic righted the injustice of keeping us out of the Jade League. Who paid for the insolence of keeping us out? The Purple Tamika Emperor, that's who. Dr. Sant preaches against him. Now I'm going to preach against Felix Rex Logos myself. Diana folded her hands together, keeping them on the table. She stared at the multitude of rings she was wearing. Finally, she looked up. There's a problem with your logic. You just told us about it, remember? Since the raid, the artifact doesn't want anything to do with you. You know that, I said. What are you suggesting? Diana said. That they, the aliens, don't know that. Look, as far as they're concerned, I'm the man when it comes to our artifact. This latest exploit will seal it. The aliens aren't going to come around asking to see me enter the artifact to prove myself. Word will sweep near space about our venture to Sanakat. The Emperor is going to make sure of that. He's giving us free publicity. In all likelihood, Diana said, he'll call you a devil. The merchants of Mecca spoke evil words against Mohammed, Murad Bey said. Diana sat back as she eyed her Earth Council confederate. I'm surprised you're agreeing to this, she told Murad Bey. Creed isn't religious, you know that. He's simply doing this as a strategic ploy. He's going to play a part. Murad Bey turned his inky eyes on me. He's sullying Mohammed's ways with his idea, Diana said. What are you trying to do? I asked her. Put a wedge between Murad Bey and me? I don't think you fight fire with fire, Diana said. What you're suggesting is too dangerous. No, I said. It's our only chance. I insist on one thing, Murad Bey told me. You must not call yourself the prophet. No one is suggesting I do, I said. But you are claiming to start a new religion, he said. Not at all, I said. I'm claiming to clean up the oldest one. These aliens have been worshipping the Creator for a long time. They've done so at the artifacts, right? What will you tell them? Murad Bey asked. I could hear the anger in his voice. If anything, his reaction proved the soundness of my idea. Few things moved people like religion. For some people, their politics was their religion. For some, football, soccer, or bowling became their most sacred belief. On Earth, in the past, communism became the religion of Karl Marx, Lenin, and hundreds of millions of true believers. In the United States, feminism had become a religion. If you spoke out against it, certain people went ballistic. 
The same held true for gun rights and a host of other issues. It seemed to be the same for aliens. If the Purple Tamika Emperor stoked aliens' passions against us through religion, we humans would soon all be dead. I had to find a like passion to pit against his idea. That meant I had to go into the holiness business. Fight fire with fire, or a crusade with a crusade. You are not the prophet, Murad Bey said stubbornly. No, I'm not. I'm Commander Creed, a plain-spoken man who entered a forerunner artifact. I make no special claims, but an ancient relic did tell me its name, and it took me to a Lohar star system to wage war against the heretic Purple Emperor. Will you try to speak words of truth? Murad Bey asked. I held my hands palm upward. I am a man, the one who entered a forerunner object. Why the ancient machine admitted me and not another is not for me to discern. I only know that the named artifact took me to the planet Sanakat. There I punished those who followed the heretic, Felix Rex Logos. Now the Purple Emperor tries to slay the one the machine of the First Ones chose to converse with alone. The humble route doesn't fit you, Diana said. Your plan smacks of gross hypocrisy. I'm not being humble, I said. I'm inserting a new idea into the game. I'm doing it in the only way the aliens might be able to hear the idea. Diana disengaged her hands using a finger to curl several strands of hair. Your idea is so brassy that maybe it will work. If it was just me alone, I said, I don't think it would fly. But given Dr. Sant and his message, I think there's a possibility some aliens will listen. Let's suppose that's so, Diana said. How will you get your message across? Yeah, I said. That could be a problem. Let me think about it for a couple of days. What do we do until you come up with a workable scheme? Diana asked. We train, I said. I'm giving the Earth Council three quarters of the new ships. I'll also forward you a goodly amount of missile launchers and particle beam cannons. You should turn the moon into a fortress. That fortress won't last long against Admiral Saris's fleet, she said. Let's build one strong point at a time. I said. That's better than sitting on our thumbs doing nothing. We talked longer, but didn't come up with anything more. Before I proceeded with my plan, I needed more information about the Emperor. Ella had a machine, and I had a tiger whose mind I'd like to open. It was time to chat with my Shifeng captive. Several days later, I walked down a steep set of rock stairs. The Lohars who built Mars Base had jackhammered the steps and the subterranean chambers out of the Red Planet. Why did you put your equipment way down here? I asked. Ella walked ahead of me. I liked the sway of her hips and the tightness of her garments. Our scientists must have turned heads back in the day. She carried a heavy flashlight, the beam jostling ahead of us. Ignoring my question, Ella came to a thick door. She withdrew a small box from a pocket, pressing a red-lit switch. With a click, the door swung open. We entered a sterile area of white corridors and red rock walls. Mats lined the floor. Is this a dungeon? I asked. Don't let your imagination get the better of you, Ella said over her shoulder. First clicking her red button again, she pushed against a door. It was heavier than the first. I followed her into the room. The odor struck me right away. A sour, rancid smell permeated everything. I saw the tiger. Two attendants watched him. The Lohar leaned forward in what looked like a tilted, backward-facing chair. They had stretched his arms in front, securing each to an arm-long rest. His chin rested in a groove and steel bands kept his head in place. Other restraints held his torso and legs, which were stretched out as far as they could go. That looks uncomfortable, I said. The two attendants snapped up, staring at me. Ella spun around, scowling. She put a finger in front of her lips. 
Slowly the tiger stirred. Maybe squirmed would be a better word. I didn't like this place. Made me wonder what the Lohars would do to me if they managed to get their paws on me. Ella moved to the attendants, whispering something into their ears. Soon the three of them went behind what looked like a lead curtain. The biggest attendant reappeared and drew it aside. Ella and the woman attendant pushed a big machine on wheels toward the tiger. The machine looked like a big refrigerator. There were lights sparkling up and down one side. The two pushed the refrigerator near the tiger. Ella nodded. The woman attendant bent low, locking the wheels into place. Ella opened a small hatch in the box. She withdrew what looked like a portable lamp a college student might have used over her desk in the dorm. She adjusted it so the shade aimed at the tiger. Returning to the refrigerator, she slid open a panel. Her fingers tapped against a pad. A light clicked on under the shade. It centered a green dot on the tiger's forehead. Ella went to the shade, manually adjusting it. She moved the dot until it beamed between the tiger's eyes. His eyelids fluttered and he twitched and groaned. The sound put goosebumps on my arms. I hated this place. The green light continued to shine on his fur. Slowly his eyelids fluttered more. He relaxed. I thought he would fall asleep. Instead, he practically slumped. The restraints held him in place, though. With a forefinger, Ella motioned me nearer. I stepped beside her in front of the tiger. She pointed at his eyes. Bending low, putting my hands on my knees, I peered into his orbs. They were glazed as if he were hypnotized. Ella picked up a stool and set it down to his left. The woman attendant took another stool sitting to his right. She clipped leads to his nostrils and another pair to his furry ears. Now don't get me wrong. I didn't have any sympathy for the Lohars. This tiger was sheep bang. The being would gladly give his life to explode others to death. Yet I didn't like to see anyone in such a situation. It seemed inhuman. Remember the 99% who died to the Lohars. The only reason he's strapped down like this is so mankind can climb out of oblivion. I sighed. Ruthlessness didn't sound so noble now. It seemed grubby and dirty, which was exactly what it was. Ella began to speak to the tiger. He didn't respond right away. The last attendant stood behind the others. A big finger tapped a switch now and then. It sent shocks to the Lohar, jerking his furry head. He yowled more than once, sounding like a wet cat. Finally, the tiger began to answer Ella's questions. He did it haltingly, with many stubborn moments of silence. I stayed, forcing myself to witness this. Later, I sat with Ella in a side room. I felt soiled. Is that what you did to Dr. Sant? I asked. Ella stared at me. We sat at a big table with snacks and drinks to the side. Neither of us ate or drank anything. Do you really want to know the answer? She finally asked me. My stomach tightened a little more. I shook my head. Ella's nostrils flared. Her mouth grew firm. She nodded. This is a dirty business, I said. Is your killing any better than what I do down here? She asked. I wanted to tell her yes. You leave people dead, Creed. You have no compunction slaughtering Lohars. I'm merely drawing out some information. Afterward, they're very much alive. How can what I'm doing down here be worse than what you do in the open? Easy, I said. It's called the Golden Rule. He who has the gold makes the rules? She asked. I don't understand what you mean. I'm talking about the other golden rule, I said. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So you'd like to be gut shot on a battlefield? She asked. I don't mind dying a warrior's death, I said. 
Getting mind raped in a dungeon? No, not so much. Once you're dead, life is over, Ella said. Those who live still have hope. No. Killing is worse than torture. It is an order of magnitude of difference. You're squeamish because of the social sensibilities you've accepted. If you strip those away... Strip those sensibilities away and you become a devil, I said with heat. A faint smile touched her lips. You don't realize how antiquated you are. The real wonder to me is how fossilized the aliens are in their mindsets. Our superior outlook allows us to survive where any other race would have already perished. I might have argued with her. In the end, I told myself this was her inner armor that allowed her to do these things. Humanity needed them done. Could I look down on her, then, for doing them? What do we know so far? I asked. Ella stared into my eyes half a second longer. Then she reached for a reader, tapping the screen, bringing up her notes. Raz Claw, the name of our Lohar, believes himself a holy warrior in an ancient fraternity, Ella began. It appears the Shi Feng have close ties with Purple Tamaika. The sacred warriors help to keep the other Tamaikas in check. They assassinate other Lohars? I asked. Oh, yes. I believe they concentrate on their own kind much more than against aliens. Did the Emperor sanction the strike against me? I asked. I wondered the same thing, Ella said. Raz Claw didn't know. He suspects so, though. That means the Purple Emperor would have already decided against us, I said. Our attack against Sanakat didn't really change anything, then. Exactly, Ella said. Along with that line of inquiry, I asked him about Admiral Saris. When Ross Claw heard about the Purple Admiral taking our warships, he hissed in appreciation. Do you know why? I asked. I queried him on that. He surmises the Emperor set humanity up for failure. This would come in two varieties. Without any self-protection, a greedy species might attack us in order to gain the artifact. We would die under their guns. Or mankind would fail to protect the artifact, possibly letting it be destroyed. In that case, righteous fury would stoke the rest of the Jade League. Soon races would demand our deaths as blood payment for our failure. I thought about that. Yes, the Emperor would have kept his hands clean. In either of those cases, he could say he'd kept his oath with us. Yes, Ella said. I scowled. What a bastard. Even before the Sonicot raid, Felix Rex Logos had plotted humanity's destruction. Helping the Lohars against Abaddon seven years ago had merely given us a little more time. It hadn't bought us good faith from the Lohars. Does Ra's Claw know why the Emperor hates humans so viciously? No, Ella said. You asked him? Oh, yes. I grabbed a package of spice sticks, but didn't tear open the alien cellophane. Shaking my head, I tossed the package back among the other goodies. The Emperor wants to annihilate us, I said. I wonder if even now a fleet races toward the solar system. According to Ra's Claw, the Emperor will come in person. Felix Rex Logos will want to make an example of us. No, I bet it's more than that, I said. Dr. Sant began his metamorphosis here. If the Emperor annihilates us and retakes the artifact, won't that negate Dr. Sant's truths? I'm not sure I follow you, Ella said. I reached out, taking the spice sticks again, opening the package. Putting one in my mouth like a cigar, I sucked on it thoughtfully. It seems simple enough, I said. If humanity becomes devilish, Anything learned in our star system becomes suspect. That would mean Sant worked with devils. It would nullify his words and likely destroy any credibility Orange Tamika gained in stopping Abaddon and the Kargs. Ella blinked thoughtfully. Yes, I see what you mean. If the other alien races and the other Tamikas believe we're vile, they'll vie to destroy us. That means it won't matter how big we become. 
will be evil. Thus we're forced to enter the religious fray. I doubt you'll make a persuasive spokesman to the other aliens, Ella said. Taking the spice stick from my mouth, I pointed it at her. And we have to find ways to increase our persuasiveness. How? Well, I asked. Did Ross Claw tell you anything useful in that regard? Pursing her lips, Ella peered at her reader. She began to tap the screen, scanning her notes. A few minutes later, she said, Here's something interesting. Let's hear it. The Shi Feng has an elite guard at Purple Tamika's Hall of Honor. So? I said. She looked up. The Lohars view the Shi Feng as a holy order in much the same way as humans viewed monks during the Middle Ages. Got it, I said. A hall of honor is something else. According to Ra's Claw, each Tamika has one. So? You're looking for an edge, Ella said. To gain one, you need to know how Lohars think. Here's my point. Why would the Shi Feng send an elite guard to the Purple Tamika Hall of Honor? They're a holy order, and they've sent their holiest to the hall. Maybe if you knew why, you'd know the Emperor's thinking better. I want to speak with Ra's Claw, I said. That could be a problem, Ella said. Why, is his mind damaged? No, Ella said. At least not how you're thinking. We worked him hard under the machine. He needs his rest before we put him under again. Forget about the machine. I'll talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Old-fashioned persuasion techniques? Asked Ella. I almost told her I wasn't a torturer. I doubted she thought of herself as one either. So it wouldn't help if I implied she was. One-on-one, -on -one, I said. It'll be just the tiger and me sitting across a table. Sometimes a straight talk is the best way to see how someone thinks. Ella appeared dubious. Well, in that case, I can have him ready to speak in... Hmm, ten hours. Good, I said. It's a date. Chapter 19 He's more dangerous than you realize, Ella told me. She and I peered through a two-way mirror. The tiger in question, Ra's Claw of the Shi Feng, sat on a chair behind a table. It looked like an old-fashioned police interrogation room. The tiger was taller than average, about seven and a half feet. He had wide shoulders and narrow hips, an athletic-looking Lohar specimen. A bare line in his stomach showed stitches where Zoe Artemis had sliced open his gut with a laser. He stared at the two-way mirror. Ella pointed that out to me. Whenever the door opens, he becomes tense. It's as if he's waiting for you. I believe that once he realizes who you are in particular, the tiger will attempt to kill you. I nodded absently, realizing I could use that to my advantage. You're not listening to me, Creed. The Lohar is a killer, one of their fighting specialists. He's a hand-to-hand -hand expert. So what? I said. Ella Timoshenko knew me better than most people did. She might have divined my thinking. Do you really believe you can defeat him that easily? She asked. I nodded. Sometimes you're not realistic, Ella said. With his internal bionics, he's probably stronger than you are. Do you even know how much I bench? He weighs more, too, she continued, ignoring me. Worst of all, he has his claws. I'm faster. If that's true, Ella said, it's not by much. He's been drugged lately and badly cut. How good can his condition be? Ella waved her hand dismissively. In his mind, we've dishonored him. Losing the stomach bomb? You can't understand his shame. He'll do just about anything to wipe away his humiliation. Assassinating humanity's leader. Whoa, 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 I said. I'm not humanity's leader. I know you keep giving the Earth Council spaceships. For some reason you don't like the idea that you're the one who wins or loses it for us. But for good or bad, Creed, everyone knows you're leading us to victory or to destruction. 
I swear I could feel the weight of that pushing down on my shoulders. I was just the chief star viking, though. Whatever you do, Ella said, don't let him know who you are. Yeah, okay, I said. Are you really sure you want to go through with... Enough already. I motioned to the attendants to open the cell door. I wish you'd let me handcuff him first, Ella said. Oh, I said. Before I forget, there's one thing. Whatever happens, don't enter the room to help. Ella gave me a hard look. Those are my orders, I said. What are you planning, Creed? Watch through the mirror, I said, and you'll find out. The bigger attendant opened the door, although the man stayed out of sight of the Shi Feng assassin. I stepped into the doorway, stopping to stare at the tiger. He grew tense, glowering, but making no move to get up. I moved into the room and listened to the door shut with a heavy womp and a click. Finally, I put my hands on my hips. What's your problem? I asked in Lohar. His eyebrows rose in surprise. I don't think he expected me to know his native tongue. I'm Commander Cree, the leader of the Forerunner Guardians. When I enter a room, you need to stand and respect. The tiger stiffened. I could almost hear Ella cursing outside the chamber. I wasn't supposed to let the tiger know I was important. Well, I had a different agenda. This was warrior to warrior. Let him come at me if he wanted. I'd kick the stuffing out of him and earn his respect in the process. I waited, but he remained seated. Fool, I said. Don't you know that your emperor once served in the Lohar Fifth Legion? I am not a fool, he rumbled. A normal person would have respected his obvious deadliness. I was anything but normal. Laughing, I pointed at the shaven line on his belly. Do Shi Feng warriors normally lose their gut bombs? The tiger moved with startling speed. With a roar, he hurled the table. It was heavy, made for abuse. Even so, the table splintered against the wall. Almost before the breaking sounds reached me, the tiger assassin leapt. Ella had told me about his bionic strength, that he was stronger than me. Because the mechanical parts had been embedded so deeply in his muscles, to remove them would have killed him. Thus we'd left them intact. The juggernaut of a killer sailed at me. Titanium-tipped claws appeared out of his fingertips. He slashed as he landed, his eyes blazing rage. I'd already decided to be elsewhere, spinning away like a galaxy-class kung fu artist. The claws left streaks in the metal, ripping steel like tinfoil. The tiger whirled around to face me. You have erred, human. I am Shi Feng. The titanium tips of his right hand touched the fur of his chest. Today you will learn what Shi Feng means. The tiger finished. I already know. He tilted his head as if questioning me. Jack Squat, I told him. You speak alien words. What do they mean? That you won't do a thing. His roar hurt my ears. All over his body, the fur stood on end. He launched himself, moving like a bullet. It was the deadliest game of tag I'd ever played. I dodged, twisted, threw myself backward, forward, and once smashed a right cross against his snout. That snapped his head back and made him stagger, giving me the opening to slide away from those claws. Gingerly touching his nose, he hissed, I do not understand. Why can't I cut you? I turned my left side to him. The cloth showed rips with blood dripping from them. You touched me, I said. If you keep trying, you might do it again. You want me to attack you? I get it now, I said. You're one of those bright tiger boys, aren't you? 
Is this another insult? Wow, you're a real Einstein. He cocked his head. That means a smart human, I said. After that, Ra's claw kept coming. Soon he panted, so froth shot from his snout and blood trickled from the stitch holes in his gut. My chest heaved, but I was in better shape than him. I'd rested these past days and eaten well. He'd had his mind probed after sustaining heavy wounds. You will die, he said. Don't tell me about it. Show me. Otherwise I'm going to believe all she fang are hopeless braggarts. He did try. His leaps had less force and his swipes came more slowly than before. Then I decided to go on the offensive. With carefully controlled attacks, I hit him in the face, in the chest, and against his arms. In retaliation, he slashed a single claw across my forehead, drawing blood that dripped into my eyes. You are a clever fighter, he said, but I am the superior warrior. Backing up, ripping off my shirt, I shredded it and bound my forehead with a strip. Then we fought some more. With a hammer blow, I broke his right wrist. Flipping him, I darted in fast and stomped on his left ankle, listening to it crunch. He never made a sound. Slowly he stood, balancing on his good one. I panted, with sweat covering my skin. You are a warrior, he said grudgingly. I am the forerunner guardian of the artifact that has told me its name. He blinked several times, finally nodding. I have seen the impossible. Yes, you did transfer with the artifact. Why has it done this for you? I cannot understand. Because your emperor has dishonored his name, I said. I do not believe this. Why then has an animal learned the name of the former Altair object? This is a mystery. I suspect the Kargs had a hand in it. You are a fool who lost his bomb, I said. You know nothing. For the first time I saw defeat in his eyes. He hung his head. I have lost my honor, he said. Today an animal has defeated me in honorable combat. I believe that I had finally reached the needed psychological moment. Rosclaw, I said. You're an even greater fool than I realized. He studied me, finally asking, Why would you say this? Because I'm not an animal, I said. I'm a man, superior to any lohar. The reason the artifact told me its name is that the machine of the First Ones realizes my superiority. He scowled. This... this cannot be. It is, I said. My victory proves my righteousness. That you have lost your honor proves you served a heretic. His head dipped lower. I am shamed, he whispered. Stepping closer, I saw the movement of his eyes. Ah, uh, Ra's claw had a final ploy in mind. I would have to let him try it before I could proceed with my plan. A new era has come to the galaxy, I said boastfully. The Lohars are losing their place of privilege. That is why the Shi Feng have failed to slay me. Ah, he said. You must be right. I took another step closer. Raising my arms, I looked away. He must not have realized I watched his reflection in the mirror. With a howl of agony, Ra's claw launched himself at me a final time. My hands blurred as I shifted. Using his momentum, I flipped him hard, hurling him against a wall. He hit and crumpled to the floor. Then I rushed in, stomping on his other ankle until I heard a crack. He groaned. 
Sleep, Rossclaw, I said, moving in, hitting him as hard as I could in the head. He slumped unconscious onto the floor. When Rossclaw came to, he lay in a bed in a sealed chamber. Ellis people had set his broken bones and put intravenous tubes in his arms. A medical monitor watched over him, beeping from time to time with flashing lights. At his first groan, I looked up from my chair. I'd been reading reports. Dimitri had spotted Starkey and Scouts in the Epsilon Indy system. That put them several jumps from the solar system. What were the Starkians doing so close to Earth? I had a good suspicion as to their motives. Too bad Dimitri couldn't have told me their leader's name. Was it Baba Gobo or someone else? You, the tiger said in a soft voice. He glanced at the tubes in his arms, noticing the casts. Why have you done this for me? Because that's what a warrior does, I said. You claim warrior status? he asked. Who's lying in the bed and who is sitting in the chair? He cocked his head in what appeared genuine puzzlement. A warrior helps his defeated foe? A warrior honors another warrior, particularly when the defeated foe gave the victor a worthy fight. Ra's claw watched me with an unblinking stare. No, I have lost my honor. I am no longer a warrior. Do you mean you did so by losing the bomb in your belly? You speak crudely, Rosclaw said. But accurately. I think you're wrong. You fought valiantly. You have retained your honor. On the pillow he moved his head from side to side. I am bigger. Faster and stronger than you are. I should have won. There is no should have in a fight, I said. There is only what is. You are taller. I am both stronger and faster. More importantly, I am smarter than you are. This may be true, he said. Yet I am supposed to be an animal. Again, with his unblinking stare, the tiger watched me. No, an animal would not have put his defeated foe in a hospital bed. This may be true, I said, mimicking his former words. He stiffened, saying, I must warn you, human. Once my bones mend, perhaps before that, I will attempt to kill you. If you come too close now, I will try it here. The warning does you credit, Rosclaw of the she Feng. I respect you more because of it. Frowning, he said, You are not like the others who toy with my mind. I am Commander Creed. I am the human who rode in the Forerunner Artifact to bring ruin to Sanakat. This is something I do not understand he said. Why should you have picked my planet to attack? Because the Purple Tamika Emperor was in the star system, I said. How could you have known he was there? I am the one to ride the artifact. I know many things. His eyes widened as if with superstitious fear. Finally he nodded. You have ridden the artifact. It is a great mystery. Yet who can speak against the one the artifact has chosen? The Purple Tamika Emperor speaks against me, I said. It will cost him dearly. Ra's claw grew thoughtful. He turned away, mumbling to himself. Then he peered at me sidelong. The Emperor has great honor the greatest among all the Tamaikas of the Lohars. It is why Purple Tamaika chooses who will wear the crown. This is no doubt true, I said. Do you claim I lie? No, you fought too well to be a liar. I laughed. 
I would not honor you if I believed you lied. Ross Claw shifted on his pillows, sitting up, regarding me solemnly. When I take your head, Commander Creed, I will clean every tissue from it. I will polish the skull with gorgon oil. After carving your name onto the bone, I will present it to the Emperor as a gift. I am sure he will set it in Purple Tamika's Hall of Honor. I've never heard of this hall, I lied. Is it important? Opening his fanged maw, Ra's claw laughed hoarsely. It is only the soul of Purple Tamika. Within the hall lies the great purple tapestry, woven from the fur of past emperors. In the hall are the many ancient trophies, the sacred fetishes, pre-space armor, a thousand tattered banners, scrolls and declamations, fragments of rock, bone, steel, and charcoal, vials of dried black blood commemorating battles and purple Tamika valor. In the center of the hall lies the undying fire. For ten thousand years it has burned. Huh, how about that? I said. Ra's claw refused to let me deter him. Your skull will reside in the hall throughout the ages. Because of the mighty deed of gifting it to the Emperor, I will regain my honor and my soul before I die. Your soul? I asked. Without honor, no Lohar is anything. With honor, any feat may be attempted. I backed away from Ra's claw, sitting in the room's single chair. I plan to keep my head, I told him. Which will make my feet all the more singular, he assured me. I gave the tiger a wintry grin. While keeping my head on my shoulders, I would like to see this Hall of Honor. It would surely be a sight. You will never see it, Ra's Claw declared. Because you'll kill me before that? I asked. That is one reason. The other is that no one but high-ranking Purple Tamika warriors and Vestals are allowed inside the wooden walls. You're telling me the Hall is old? Ancient, Ra's Claw said. After the Forerunner objects, it is the most heavily guarded place in Purple Tamika control. Oh, I said. In that case, maybe I'll have to force my way into the hall. The tiger shook his head before wincing and closing his eyes. It would sully the honor of Purple Tamika if you set eyes upon the trophies and fetishes. The present emperor would be forced to step down for one of his brothers. No, Commander Creed. You will never see these things, but your skull will sit there. It was my turn to give the Lohar an unblinking stare. He opened his eyes and bristled under the scrutiny. Have I dishonored you by speaking these truths? he asked. With a start, I shook my head. He'd given me an idea. No, I said. You have given me many sad thoughts to reflect upon. Why sad? he asked. Because we humans lack a hall of honor of our own, I said. I am not surprised to hear this. You are earthlings, little better than beasts of the field. You lack a single Tamika. How could you then have a hall of honor? He yawned, and I could see that he was exhausted. Sleep, Rasclaw. Regain your strength. You're going to need it soon. We will fight again? He asked, hopefully. No, I thought to myself. You'll need your strength so Ella can discover from you the location of this hall of honor. It sounded like just the place for a Star Viking raid. That meant the tiger would have to go under the Jelk machine at least one more time. Chapter 20 I left Mars Base to inspect the Luna defenses. For the journey, I went in a new patrol boat, Achilles. 
The warship had narrow corridors, but a large enough cargo bay to hold a gym. There I met the new captain, a woman upgraded from an Arbonne leader to a patrol boat commander. Zoe Artemis had dark hair and darker eyes. She was slender, with small breasts, boyish hips, and a deadly quickness. She was lithe like a lynx. Her beauty rested in her eyes and the shape of her triangular chin. One of my command maxims was to reward initiative and thought. Both were too rare. In having her troopers restrain me on Sanakat, Zoe had shown both in large quantities. Humanity only had a handful of warships. Therefore, I wanted proven doers in charge of them. We needed every force multiplier we could get. After finishing my calisthenics, I toweled my face and watched Zoe hit a heavy bag. Her thuds rocked the bag. Her snap kicks made it swing. Nice, I said. I hope you don't want to spar, sir, she said. I shook my head. I'd like to thank you again, Commander, for this chance. You don't have to thank me, I said. Your initiative won you the opportunity. Well, can a woman be grateful? she asked. Did the look in her eyes offer me more? It was possible. Why don't you show me around the ship, I said. We talked about Sanakat as we toured the engine room, the particle beam generator, and finally ended in the control room. It had five people in a semicircle facing a viewing port. Zoe's chair was behind them. Outside in space were a thousand stars with Earth and Luna among them. To the left, the sun blazed. Zoe turned to me. The top of her head reached as high as my shoulders. Can I ask you a question, sir? Please, I said. Do you think we can hold the solar system? You need to be more specific, I said. No, that's my question. Can we hold Earth against invaders? Probably not, I admitted. Will you fight here no matter what? She asked. What's on your mind, Captain? I noticed the others at their stations listening carefully. What's more important, sir? Zoe asked. Holding and possibly dying at our home, or surviving as a people? Surviving, I said. Like the Starkians survive? She asked. If we have to, I said. Zoe pursed her lips. I tend to agree with you, sir. Then I think about Admiral Saris bringing her battle fleet, or the Starkians swarming here again. It makes my blood boil thinking of them chasing us from our home. I agree, I said. We need more warships, sir. We need more people. We need our planet back. It will be generations until we're anywhere close to having billions again. Zoe scrunched her brow in thought. Then she brightened. The Jelks stole enough humans in the past. Why not open up the Earth to those outcasts and let them settle here? Her words struck in my heart. My lost girlfriend Jennifer hadn't been born on Earth, but in Jelk space. The alien abductors had taken her mom and dad during World War II. There were countless others like her. The Jelk had visited our world for centuries. The little red aliens had millions of tame, Earth-descended humans. The jail could come the last time to pick us wild people, the barbarians that would make good soldiers. Maybe with training we could turn the tame, civilized slaves back into fighters. For sure their children would learn the hard arts needed for remaining free. Laughing, I squeezed Zoe's shoulder. That's an excellent idea. If we win through all this, that's exactly what we'll do. The patrol boat captain grinned. She looked even prettier as she smiled. I noticed several of the bridge crew still watching. I hadn't taken my hand away. Zoe raised an eyebrow. Before I released her, I squeezed her shoulder a second time. Yeah, I know. I shouldn't have done that. Jennifer remained a baddened slave. Until I'd freed her, how could I love another woman? 
Yet that had been seven years ago. How long did I have to mourn Jennifer? With a start, I removed my hand. No one spoke for a time. Finally, Zoe cleared her throat. Can I ask you another question, sir? You bet, I said. What will we do when Admiral Sarah shows up? I mean, you do think she'll show up, don't you? The Emperor threatened us with a crusade. Eventually, the Lohars are going to want a pound of flesh for what we did on Sanakat. Will the artifact help us again? Zoe asked. We shouldn't count on it, I said, remembering what Holgatha had told me. So either we need more warships or allies. That about sums it up, I said. She thought about that, soon asking, Who among the Jade League will fight against the Lohars? That was the question. I'd been racking my brain about it for some time. Ra's Claw had given us a possibility. If we raided this Hall of Honor and stole all the loot, would Felix Rex Logos make a deal with us to get it back? Did Orange to Micah have any warships left? If they did, would they be enough, combined with our paltry numbers, to make a difference? I had a feeling Orange to Micah did not have enough. That's why Dr. Sant walked the worlds, trying to drum up aid through his preaching. I left the bridge, feeling worse than before. The Lohar had a crusade building against us. How did we build one of our own against them that mattered? Half a day later, the Achilles braked as we neared Luna. Two Earth Council cruisers and a missile ship orbited the dead planetoid. At the lunar north pole waited Exarian missile launchers and laser cannons. Intermingled among them were shorter-range Lohar particle beam accelerators. This was our fortress. It possessed greater firepower than any three of our starships. I bid Zoe goodbye and used a thruster pack down to Luna. Floating in the void gave me time to think. I set my course for the lunar north pole. Afterward, I studied the blue-green ball of Earth in the distance. Look at our home world. It was so beautiful, like the greatest gem in the universe set off by the blackness around it. The automated factories down there churned every hour. Diana had a crew using the scrubbers we'd taken off Sanakat, burning away biotoxins. Given enough time, we'd make our sweet home habitable again. That was one of my great goals. Then I had to defend Saul. How could we do that? I liked Zoe's idea to bring all the human waifs back home and train them to think like free people. Most of them were presently slaves or servants of the Jelk, as Jennifer used to be. Who exactly did the Jelk Corporation fight a thousand light years away from here? I would have liked to know. With a shrug, I realized I'd have to save that for another day, another war. First, mankind had to survive a holy tiger crusade. We need numbers. We need hordes of warships. I grimaced, shaking my head. It was an impossible problem. No, I told myself. That's BS. You have to think, Creed. You're missing something vital. What is it? Maybe I needed to consider this logically. We were few and faced many. The other aliens thought of us as animals. We needed allies, but who would join us? Other desperate aliens might throw in their lot with us. But why would they do so if we were weak? The Forerunner artifact is the key, I thought to myself. Felix Rex Logos had once been the commander of the Lohar Fifth Legion. We assault troopers had helped to decimate them. Holgatha had transferred rather than letting Starkians reach its surface. All the artifacts hated the baboons. That was funny because the Starkians desperately wanted their own artifact. One of the reasons was to wipe away the ancient shame of losing theirs. Thus Baba Gobo... My jaw hung open. I had it. I knew the answer to one of our problems. Chinning on my helmet radio, I hailed the Achilles. Soon enough, Zoe appeared on my HUD. Captain, I said. 
Yes, Commander? She asked. Hold your position, I said. I'm coming back up. Sir? Once I'm aboard, we're heading back to Mars base. Commander Creed out. I chinned off the link and throttled my thruster pack to full acceleration. Instead of floating down to the moon, I shot back up to the waiting patrol boat. Several days later, I strode through Mars base with Zoe hurrying to keep up. I'd kept to my own quarters during the trip back, carefully considering every angle. At a three-meter fountain in the middle of the dome, I met Ella and N7. Dimitri and Rollo were both out on patrols. The orange-skinned dome spread out over us with squat buildings pressed together on the ground. Sunlight shined through the shielding material. I could feel the heat on my neck. The geyser of water sprayed down onto the main basin. Goldfish swam in the water. It was good to see them, reminding us of better days. I have an idea, I said in lieu of a greeting. Ella looked tired with bags under her eyes. I'm sorry, Commander. I have bad news for you. What is it? I asked. Ras Claw is dead, she said. What? How? I realized it truly saddened me losing him. Maybe fighting Ra's hand-to-hand -hand had caused me to gain respect for him. Did the jilt machine kill him? No, Ella said. He did it, strangling himself. Why? I asked, dumbfounded. He didn't want to confirm the coordinates to the Purple Tamika Hall of Honor. That left me blinking. Ra's claw must have realized I'd tricked him. I should have known he'd figure that out in time. Well, I couldn't do anything about it now. He'd simply become another casualty in the human-tiger war. I had to concentrate on victory, which meant stealing my heart one more time. Did you get the location? I asked. Maybe, Ella said. No, you have to know. It's vital for my plan. I have a location, Ella said. Since Ra's Claw slew himself, I don't know if it's the right planet. Either he killed himself in shame, realizing we'd tricked him, or he lied about the location and killed himself to keep us from forcing the true location from him. That could be a big problem, but I didn't want to thrash it out this second. Okay, I said. That might put a serious kink in my plan. I still have a new idea. Are you ready for it? The others nodded. Simply put, I said, our problem is a lack of numbers. We don't have enough warships to give a big fleet pause. That means we need more. We need allies. We've been over all this before, Ella said. Right, I said. Now I realize I've been looking at this the wrong way. I've been thinking about how to persuade Jade League members to join us but I doubt any of them are going to listen to humans. You finally realize that no alien cares you rode inside the artifact, Ella said. You're dead wrong, I told her. They're going to care, but maybe not enough. We need more persuasion. Usually a person has to have a great desire. That's the fulcrum you use to change their key ideals. Are you speaking about Orange Tamika? N7 asked. That's one group, I said. We have to find Dr. Sant and tell him the situation. Yet there's another large group of aliens with a desperate desire. The Starkians. Ella stared at me a second before she laughed. You can't seriously mean them. Everyone hates the Starkians. Exactly, I said. And why do they hate the Starkians? Because the baboons destroyed their artifact. The Forerunner objects all hate Starkians, too, and won't let them near any of them. What is your idea? Ella asked. To find Baba Gobo and make a deal with him, I said. If the Starkians will gather their flotillas, I'm betting that would make a tremendous fleet. If it's big enough, that might slow down Admiral Ceres when she shows up. And that might give us enough time to raid the Hall of Honor. Commander, N7 said. The Starkians are notorious double-dealers. If you allow them in the solar system... They can never enter the solar system in any depth, I said. 
That would risk having the artifact depart and spoil everything. Then what good is your plan? Ella asked. The Starkians want to win an artifact and you can't give them one. No, I said. That's exactly what I can give them. You're not making sense, Ella said. I turned to Zoe. Would you be willing to take me to Epsilon Indy? Yes, she said quietly. Ella glanced from Zoe to me. You're likely sealing your deaths doing that. I suspect you want to speak directly with the Starkians in that star system. Ignoring Ella, I said, And Seven, I want you to come with me. This will be just like old times when we went to see Nagagobo aboard his flagship. The android dipped his head in acknowledgement. Good, he would come. I didn't want to do this without him. This is a bad idea, Creed, Ella said. Those kinds of ideas might be all we have left, I said. A Lohar crusading fleet is likely going to hit us soon. We have to meet it or we're all dead anyway. Doesn't that mean taking risks? Ella said nothing. I think it does, Zoe told me. I grinned at her. It's settled, then. N7, get your kit. We're going to leave in an hour. Chapter 21 It took three jumps to reach Epsilon Indy, which translated to eight days of travel. The longest parts, the light years between gates, took the least amount of time. Moving from one gate to the next in a star system took the most time, accelerating and decelerating. In a straight line, Epsilon Indy was twelve light years from Earth. The system had an unusual feature. Epsilon Indy was a K-spectral class star, about three-fourths the mass of the Sun with a slightly higher gravity. What made the system interesting were the companions. Binary brown dwarfs, objects with a mass of fifty Jupiters, orbited Epsilon Indy at 1500 AUs. They were both T-class brown dwarfs with a separation between them of 2.1 AU. We stayed far from the star and the brown dwarfs. So did the Starkian fleet. Yes, they were in the Epsilon Indy system. That made this easier as we didn't have to hunt them down. An hour had passed since I'd spoken with Baba Gobo via screen. Almost gleefully, the chief baboon had given us permission to fly out to meet him on his flagship. Since assurances for our safety seemed superfluous, we went without them. N7 and I wore vac suits with thruster packs spewing hydrogen spray. We sailed toward a large, shark-shaped vessel sliding closer toward our patrol boat. The majority of the Starkian fleet waited in orbit around a nickel-iron planet. Bright lights showed shuttles lifting from the surface. They must have been mining boats, bringing the ore to one of their giant starships. N7 had told me before those were the factory vessels. In time, N7 and I passed through a bay door into a Starkian ship the size of Manhattan Island. I felt like a flea landing on an elephant. With our packs vibrating, we came down onto a deck. Various starfighters were packed nearby, but no baboons were visible. Behind us, the bay door slid shut, closing with a clang. It told me an atmosphere already hissed into place. Otherwise, we wouldn't have heard the sound waves. A hum began, and I stumbled. The place had gravity again, the deck plates turning on. Just like the last time I entered a Starkian vessel eight years ago, no one greeted us. N7 removed his helmet. I did the same with mine. The air stank like a monkey's zoo cage. Some things never changed. Ah, we're home, I said. N7 gave me a quizzical glance. A joke, I said. Let's get started. My gut roiled with unease. I was more than nervous. We marched to a bank of hatches. The middle one dilated open. Despite my resolve, I took a deep breath. I shouldn't have done that. The stink seemed to lodge down near my throat. Coughing, with my head bent, I followed N7 along narrow corridors better suited to Rottweilers. 
The bulkhead seemed to close in around us, and the corridors turned much too sharply at times. As before, there were fist-sized portholes along the bottom of the walls like giant mouse holes. I still didn't know what they were for. The blinking dots leading N7 brought us to a small hatch. It opened, and a greater stink wafted out. That increased my coughing. N7 glanced at me. I forced myself to stop hacking, nodding for him to go. He led, I followed, both of us ducking in order to enter a far too low-ceilinged chamber filled with Starkian commanders. This time I could tell. They grinned like predators, each of them gleeful. As before, they wore harnesses and tubular guns. Instead of a table, they sat on low daises, seven important-looking lords. Each had gray or white-streaked mane. The biggest Starkian had a shiny white mane with horribly red-rimmed eyes. I walked toward Baba Gobo. That started the baboons hooting and flailing their arms. Two reached for their tubular guns. I halted beside N7, switching on my translating device. With a slight bow of my head, I said, It is good to see you again, Baba Gobo. The mighty High Lord Baboon took his time answering. He was an alien, but I could tell he dearly loved the situation. I would have liked to know Starkian beliefs concerning torture. It didn't help that I'd recently watched Ella torment Ra's claw. Was I going to get exactly what I'd given? I hoped not. Commander Creed, Baba Gobo drawled. This is a welcome surprise, he said. You do realize that you shall never leave this vessel? For once I restrained myself from speaking too forcefully. I found that difficult. I know that you have a hard decision to make, I said. Me? Hard? The High Lord Baboon showed off his yellow canines, glancing at his elders. They hooted with the best of them. A few jumped up and down on their daises. It was quite a sight. As they grew quieter, Baba Gobo turned back to me. I believe today's decisions will prove easy and enjoyable, he said. It is not often that a Starkian's enemy freely places himself in our hands. My only curiosity is why you've become so foolish. Need, I said. Hope? Yes, he said. To be needy is bad. To hope for the best often leads one into traps he cannot escape. All Starkians know this. That is why we are the most cunning race in the Orion Arm. Well, that's why I'm here. Actually, your cunning has become a cul-de-sac for your species. It's the reason you're the gypsies of space. His brows thundered. What are these gypsies? he asked. Wanderers, nomads, people without a settled abode. Oh, he shook his head. You are wrong, human, in thinking we are forced into this. It is a survival trait, our way. We Starkians do not wish to hamper ourselves by settling into any one particular place. No, you're wrong, I said. That's exactly what has happened. Others have forced you into this wandering existence. There's no other reason for it. The good humor vanished from Baba Gobo. He leaned forward, stabbing a dirty finger at me. There was dirt impacted under the fingernail. What does an animal only recently allowed into space know about the great Starkian people? I glanced at each elder in turn. You're kidding me, right? I asked. Vain beast, Baba Gobo said. You are not safely aboard one of your warships. You stand with a mobile thinking machine before the elders of our fleet. Your hours of life are quickly dwindling. A single word from me will end your existence. Ponder that instead of spouting your vulgarities. Holgatha, I said. 
Baba Gobo scowled worse than before. What does that nonsense word mean? It does not translate into a Starkian meaning. How interesting, I said. I've just told you the name of the Forerunner artifact in the solar system. It took him a second to understand my meaning. When he did, his red eyes squinted with suspicion. You lie, he said. No, I'm telling you the truth. Are you that foolish? The evidence does not support the idea. Why would you give me the name, Beast, knowing as you must that it is a marvelous treasure? For some it's a treasure, I said. For any who possess the name, he said. Tell me, Baba Gobo, what will you as a Starkian do with your newfound knowledge? He glanced at his silent fellows before regarding me again. Do you truly not understand? I will go to your solar system and lay claim to Holgathar. He said the artifact's name slowly, tasting it with joy and satisfaction. I would advise against such an action, I said. Baba Gobo hooted with Starkian laughter. Why would I care what an animal advised me to do? Let's consider the question, as it's an important one. Suppose I'm an animal, as you claim. Why would a forerunner artifact tell me its name, then? Several of the elders glanced at Baba Gobo. He pretended to ignore them, although he frowned at me. You've just received the name of a forerunner object, Holgatha. But if you're right, that I, an animal, gave it to you, won't the other races laugh when you tell them how you came to learn the name? Baba Gobo closed his eyes and rested his snout on a fist. He sat like a statue for several seconds. Then his eyes snapped open. He looked upon me with wonder. You are not an animal, he said. Correct. With the same dirty finger he'd pointed at me earlier, Baba Gobo stroked his lower lip. At last he asked, Why have you told me the sacred name? Before I answer that, you should know that we used Holgatha to transfer to the Sanakat star system. That's deep in the Lohar Empire. I am quite aware of the location of the Sanakat system. I nodded. We raided the planet of Sanakat, dropping nuclear warheads onto the surface. Baba Gobo gave a start. Several elders murmured in wonder. Why would you do this? he asked, sounding amazed. For a simple reason, I said. The Purple Tamika Emperor was in the system. I wished to teach him a lesson. The baboon scowled. You teach the great Lohar Emperor a lesson? No, not even you are that rash. You are spouting lies to me. Think well, Baba Gobo, I said. If you truly believe I lie about our Sanakat attack, then Holgatha is not the artifact's name. For several seconds he stared at me in silence. I could see his mind spinning. Soon he nodded. You are cleverer than I realized. It was a grudging admission. Then his eyes widened. Ah, I believe I understand now. The artifact must have found you unworthy. That has angered you, yes? To gain revenge on the object, you have run to the Starkians. That's not even close, I said. I came to you because Holgatha told me the ancient history. He explained how the Starkians once possessed a forerunner artifact of their own. They lost it, however, and the other races attacked your ancestors because of it. Their delayed reaction startled me. It seemed as if it took the words time to percolate into their skulls. Then, as one, the Starkians lifted their snouts toward the low ceiling. They howled in despair. It was a mournful noise. Soon Baba Gobo lowered his snout and said, You must die. It is our custom to kill any who repeats the wretched story of old. 
You want to kill me, even as I offer you the chance to redeem your race. What do you mean? Baba Gobo asked hoarsely. It's simple, I said. The Emperor of the Lohars comes to Earth. He preaches a holy crusade against us and wishes to annihilate humanity in person. Then you are as good as dead. No, I'm not, I said. The Emperor is a heretic. Thus his crusade is doomed to fail. What folly do you spout? It's pure logic, Baba Gobo. Think about it. Holgatha brought us to the Sanakat system. There the assault troopers slaughtered Lohars. There the Emperor himself witnessed our daring. Now you have to ask yourself the question. Why did the artifact take us to the place where we could fight the Emperor? The answer is simple. Felix Rex Logos called humans beasts. He would not admit us into the Jade League. Yet the Forerunner object has told me its name. It has shown me we belong. The Emperor has sullied himself with his heresy. Now the ancient artifacts move against him. Slowly, Baba Gobo nodded. That is an interesting argument. It might actually sway some. Dr. Sant of Orange to Micah preaches against the purple, and thus the Emperor, I said. This is an opportunity for those with eyes to see. Baba Gobo glanced at the elders. One of them nodded. Regarding me, the chief baboon asked, If we helped you, you will give us full control of the artifact? Baba Gobo of the Starkians, I said in a ringing voice, I am about to tell you the ancient history of the universe. It is the truth. This is what Holgatha told me about the Starkians. I then repeated the story in all its details, particularly the part where the Forerunner artifacts decided that no Starkian would ever walk on them again. That caused the baboons to howl longer and with more misery than before. This is a lie, Baba Gobo whispered. Your despair shows me you know better. His entire body sagged. Several of the elders crouched low, covering their heads. Go, Baba Gobo said hoarsely. Leave our vessel and leave the Epsilon Indy system. Never return. No. I came here for Starkian aid, and that aid I will get. You are mad, Commander Creed. There is nothing you can offer to entice us to help a doomed species. You should listen to me first. I can help you gain redemption in the eyes of the other races. They will think the Forerunner artifact approves of you. Then the Starkians will no longer have to wander the star lanes as gypsies. Baba Gobo studied me for the longest time. Finally, he raised a baboon hand, groping in the air as if he was a baby. I had struck upon the great Starkian desire to have an artifact, to win their way back into the good graces of the others. Could he dare trust me? Would his hatred and despair be too great? How, he said, how can you do this for the Starkians? In that moment, I knew I had him. Hiding my excitement, I took a step closer. Would you know our great secret? I asked. Yes. We will fight the Emperor's fleet a jump before the solar system. We will mass such numbers of ships that he will pause in bewilderment. Can you know what route the invasion fleet will take? He asked. I won't have to, I said. Starkians are the Orion Arm's greatest scouts. They will seek the Emperor's fleet and report back so our mass can intercept them. Who told you we are the greatest scouts? It's obvious, I said. You're the nomads of space. Back on Earth, our nomads always made the best light cavalry. This is not Earth. But you are nomads, I said. Your existence relies on speed and knowledge. If you had to fight at the other race's whims, the Starkians would have already been dead. That you have survived this long shows me you know how to maneuver out of the way of stronger forces. That implies speed. 
You are cunning, Baba Gobo said. And it is true. None can match us as scouts. Yet we speak about the purple Tamaika of the Lohars. They are fierce soldiers, enjoying head-to-head -head battle. Few dare to stand in the path of a Lohar battle fleet. That's not my plan. We'll raid the crusading fleet the entire distance, striking like Plains Indians of the American West. I do not perceive your meaning. Hit and run, I said. That I do understand. We might bloody them, but it won't stop the Lohars. You're going to buy us time, I said. In order to do what? he asked. I grinned. The Star Vikings are going to save the day by producing the soul of Purple Tamika. Who are these Vikings? Baba Gobo asked. What do you mean, soul of the Lohars? Star Vikings, I said, thumping a hand against my chest. Then I bowed at the waist. You? he asked. How can you acquire the soul of the Lohars? You weren't listening close enough, I told him. I'll bring the soul of the Purple Tamika Lohars to the battlefield. There they will not dare to risk its destruction. Baba Gobo scratched his baboon chin. If you can do as you say, I fail to see how that will win the Starkians their redemption. I want to save the solar system. If I achieve that, I'm not worried about who gets the credit for stopping the Lohar Crusade. If the Emperor races to Earth, and then he and his fleet reels back in defeat, people will demand to know how that happened. I will say, the Starkians outfought the Purple Tamika Lohars. They did it to defend Holgatha the Forerunner Artifact. As Holgatha's spokesman, I will say the machine has forgiven your old mistake. This is a new era where Starkians have honor. Baba Gobo scowled. We already have honor. No, you don't. Several of the elders hooted with outrage. Hey, I said. Get real. I'm the one who walked alone onto your flagship. I did it without assurances. You must have wondered how I could have been so foolish. Baba Gobo glanced at the elders. Several nodded. Yes, the old baboon said. We wondered why you'd taken leave of your senses. Clearly I had a plan. You even liked my plan. It turns out that I knew exactly what I was doing. So it would appear, Baba Gobo admitted. I'm the man who told you the name of Holgatha. I asked for nothing in return. Yes, Baba Gobo said. That is strange. I'm Commander Creed, I said. I do things my way and I kick ass. If you want a piece of the purple to Michael Lohar, you have to listen to me and you have to learn to trust me. Trust is not the Starkian way, Baba Gobo said. And look where that's gotten you. I said. We have survived the ages. Yeah, on the run, hated and despised by all. Oh yeah, that's really impressive. In case you can't tell, I'm being sarcastic. Behind me, N7 poked a warning finger in my back. Look, Baba Gobo, I said. Prince Venturi of Orange to Mica came to me for Earth Troopers. He wanted the best fighters in order to save our universe. Well, the prince didn't survive. But I did. We smashed Abaddon and defeated his cargs on the portal planet. I have a track record of defeating whoever faces me. If the Starkians want in this time, join up and reap the rewards. Will there be others beside us to fight the Purple Tamika Lohars? Baba Gobo asked. Of course, I lied, hoping I could find others. Where was Dr. Sant? This is the Holgatha Crusade, I said. We're going to gather the biggest fleet ever seen and smash the heretics who thought to stamp out humanity and ostracize the Starkians. You're going to be in the limelight, my friend. That isn't the Starkian way, Baba Gobo muttered. We have worked from the shadows for a long time. 
I nodded vigorously. Can you imagine how many Starkian flotillas there are? No Starkian ever wonders about that, he said. Once we had many fleets. Now only seven remain. Okay, that's your first assignment. You gather the Starkian remnants into one place. I'll grab the orange to Mike Alohars and snatch the soul of the purple. Baba Gobo stared at me for a time. Would you wait outside, please, as we confer on this? he asked. With pleasure, I said. Together, N7 and I walked into the corridor. The hatch closed behind us, and the elders must have begun to talk. I don't understand how you hope to achieve your goal, N7 whispered. How can you say that? You've been with me the entire time. The Starkians have never done as you suggested. Right, I said. That's what I'm bringing to the table. New ideas. Haven't you learned yet that's the most powerful thing in the universe? I am learning, N7 said. We could hear their voices through the sealed hatch, but not their individual words. Traveling up the corridors to us were internal ship clangs and hisses. There was a surprising amount of those noises. There is a thing that troubles me, N7 said. Yeah? Why does Baba Gobo listen to you? I would not have believed it unless I saw it. I grinned. I gave him something incredible for free. That baffled him. It threw him off his normal pattern. That made him susceptible to my confidence. Why would this be? N7 asked. Because he can't understand the source of my confidence, I said. Neither can I, the android said. I made a soft sound and frowned down at my boots. It's called balls to the firewall. I lack human reproductive organs. I nodded. Why would testicles make the difference? N7 asked. Smoke and mirrors, I said. Fast-talking and atomic self-assurance. That persuades people. Besides, I've been lucky a few times. People start to wonder about that. They figure there has to be a reason for my successes. What could be the reason? It baffles them. Finally, they figure he must be something special, maybe a battle genius or something. Now, I don't believe that myself. This entire episode began in Antarctica when I grabbed a rifle and stormed a space lander. Basically, I've been doing the same thing, only on a grander scale each time. The gall throws people off. Extraordinary, N7 said. Maybe, I said. Growing up, I used to read about a guy called Charles XII of Sweden. He was the berserker knight errant, constantly fighting three to one, five to one, and even eight to one odds, battles, and winning. Charles could do anything, N7 asked. No. In the end, he lost the Swedish Empire. The king was crazy, and his lopsided battles finally caught up with him on the field of Poltava. Did he die there? No. He escaped to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, waging war against Russia from the court of another ruler. What happened to the berserker knight errant in the end? N7 asked. I took my time answering. At a siege in Norway, he was shot in the head, from behind. Most commentators speculate that one of his own troops finally had enough of his endless wars. Is that what will happen to you? N7 asked. I don't see how it couldn't, I said, shrugging, pretending I didn't care. But it doesn't matter. I plan to be the berserker star viking, doing whatever I have to in order to give humanity its place among the stars. The hatch opened before N7 could respond. The smallest elder beckoned us within. In silence and under the staring eyes of Baba Gobo and his elders, N7 and I walked before them. Commander Creed, the white-maned baboon said. I dipped my head in acknowledgment. We are impressed with your courage, Baba Gobo said. And you are a cunning military officer. But we cannot agree to face the might of a Lohar crusade. 
one bent on destroying humans. The Starkians will sit out this battle and war. What? I said. But... but... what had I done wrong? I'd been sure they would agree to my plan. Baba Gobo shook his head. We are decided on this. Yet I have this to say. For your gift of the name Holgatha, we grant you your life. Goodbye, Commander Creed. May the Creator have mercy on your soul and on the lives of your people. I do not think any of you have long to live. Chapter 22 Depressed, I returned to patrol boat Achilles. This should have worked. If all the Starkians had gathered their warships and used their speed, we could have harried the Emperor's fleet. They lack courage, I told N7 as we took off our helmets in the patrol boat's locker room. The android nodded. I wondered if he thought I lacked foresight. I'd been so sure Baba Gobo would join us. It had been obvious to me. After leaving the Epsilon Indy system, I sat morosely in my cabin. The odds against humanity had turned horribly long again. Several hours later, I stalked through the corridors into the cargo hold. There I wrapped my fists. I began to smash the heavy bag, thudding blow after blow. What do you want to hear? I bet I know. Zoe Artemis came to talk to me. We made passionate love. Everything cleared up in my head and I saved the day. No such luck, I'm afraid. Real life doesn't often work like that. I hammered the heavy bag until my arms hung at my sides. Sweat soaked my t-shirt. My hands ached. Standing in front of the swaying bag, I realized this was our problem. Humanity had to gather its paltry number of ships and hightail it elsewhere. For a time in his life, Genghis Khan had done exactly that. No, that wasn't quite right. He'd become a sneaky young man, but he'd kept the nucleus of his Mongols on their ancestral lands. Some things were worth dying for. Ra's Claw had showed me that. The tiger strangled himself rather than reveal the location of the Purple Tamika Hall of Honor. Or had our Shi Feng captive slain himself out of shame? Maybe he had given us the right location, though. Raising my fists, I whacked the bag another few times. Then I stood flat-footed and began to wail on it. I did so until I staggered backward and slammed down onto my butt. I sucked down air. Sweat dripped from my face. Slowly, my breathing evened out. The Shi Feng had started this mess. The exploding tigers had tried to take me down in Wyoming. I closed my eyes, listening to my heart thud. Maybe that's how this one had to go down. We were in a game of commando raids. The Lohar Emperor had used the Shi Feng. I planned to hit back with the Star Vikings. I'd done it once already, and it had given us more ships, more guns, and more information through Ra's Claw. It had also given us a more direct problem, a genocidal Lohar holy crusade. Climbing to my feet, I began to unwrap my hands. Maybe I'd lost my touch. How long could someone continue to pull a rabbit out of the hat? I wasn't a stage magician, but a combat soldier. No, you're a star viking now. If one avenue fails, you try another one. The Starkians aren't going to help you. That means everything rests on raiding the Hall of Honor. Grabbing the bandages, using a forearm to wipe sweat from my eyes, I headed for the exit. It was time to closet myself in my room and come up with a better plan. A week later, I sat with Rollo, Dimitri, N7, and Ella around a dinner table in Ceres Asteroid. We ate steak kebabs with rice pilaf and pineapple slices. Afterward, we watched an old Avengers movie in the next room. The credits finally played, and I said, Lights! We sat in big easy chairs, sipping our favorite alcoholic beverages. It's time to decide, I said. Do you mean what to do against Purple Tamika's Hall of Honor? Ella said. That's right. 
You realize Ra's claw may have given us false directions, she said. That's coloring my idea on how we should attempt this, I said. Oh? she asked. I rattled the ice cubes in my glass and sipped the last of the scotch whiskey. I don't know if Horus is the Lohar planet of origin or not, I began. I don't believe it is, Ella said. But for reasons we haven't divined yet, the planet Horus is important to Purple Tamaika. What can you tell us about it? I asked N7. The android shrugged. You don't know? I asked him. I do not, Commander. I am sorry. I've discovered a little, Ella said. While under the Jelk machine, Ra's claw gave away a few hints. Horus is a swamp world, dismal with thick fogs and giant snake creatures. Vast trees grow there. Chopped down and cured, the wood is almost as tough as steel. From what Ra's claw said, the hall is fashioned from such lumber. Did you learn anything more? I asked. After that, no. Nothing concrete. I tilted the glass to my mouth, sucking on an ice cube. After crunching it, I said, Tell us what you surmise about the place. What seems likely? Ella swirled the wine in her goblet, staring at it. There will be war pickets in orbit, and surely ceremonial guards on the surface. I suspect the Shi Feng will guard the hall. They will no doubt prove deadly. This is going to be a commando raid, I said. That means stealth is going to count for as much as hard fighting. How many assault troopers and ships will you use? Ella asked. One transport, I said, along with one hundred star vikings. Why so few? Rollo asked. We're not going to fight our way down because I think we'd fail if we tried it like that. We have to slip into the hall, steal what we can carry, and run away as fast as we can. That's why we're taking a patrol boat along. Won't that look suspicious? Ella asked. The patrol boat will be in the transport. After the strike, we unship it and run back for Earth as fast as we can. Patrol boats are fast, Dimitri said. But that's about all they are. I nodded. I want in. Rollo said thoughtfully. Me too, Dimitri said. You'll need my expertise, Ella told me. I pointed at each of them in turn and said, No, no, and no. Someone has to stay here in case my plan backfires. Rollo scowled in an angry way. In the old days, I wouldn't have cared. These days, the big guy had become scary. You're not thinking this through, he said. In the past, you've grabbed the dice of fate and placed everything on one wild gamble. And you've won big. I know, I said. That's why you're staying back this time. Sooner or later, the dice are going to roll against me. Look at what happened aboard the Starkian flagship. I failed. If I fall on my face out there, I want you people to carry on back here. You're wrong about this, Creed, Rollo said. We're staking everything on grabbing the articles in the Hall of Honor. If we fail, humanity has to run away from the solar system. Practically speaking, we'll have to flee to the Jelk Corporation and hide there. That would probably mean the end of our freedom, I said. Which is why I'm coming along, Rollo said. If this is our only chance, we have to front load the dice. I'm going to, Dimitri added. On this, my mind is made up. I already lost Jennifer, I said. I don't want to lose any of you, too. That is touching, Ella said. It is also uncharacteristic of your decision-making. You cannot use your heart in this. You need us because we have worked as a team for a long time. No one is better than the five of us together. She has a point, Commander, N7 told me. Maybe the whiskey did the thinking... Maybe I didn't realize how beat down the Starkian refusal had left me. I didn't have enough fight left to disagree with the four of them. Okay, I said. You're all in. It's probably just as well. I have a feeling we're going to have to do a lot of on-the-fly thinking if we're going to pull this one off. I have a question, Ella said. Shoot. 
Do we have enough time to reach Horus, loot the hall, and return to Earth before the Emperor's fleet arrives in the solar system? I snorted quietly. That was yet another problem. Even if we got the needed articles, we might not make it back in time to save humanity. I don't know, I said. Let's call it a night so we can start first thing tomorrow morning. We should have left a week ago already. Storing Achilles in the transport took longer than I expected. Then I had to choose the 100 Star Vikings. I debated skimming the heroes from each Zagoon. Soon I realized that was the wrong way to do it. I studied the records and decided on one of Dimitri's Zagoons. It had the best combat record. Unfortunately, it only had 87 effectives. Still, they would be the commandos, the Star Vikings I used for the strike. Zoe would have a Zagoon of troopers to run the transport. Dimitri's led the assault team. I wanted a unified battle group where the members implicitly trusted one another. A well-led combat team became greater than the men and women in it. Three days later, the Peru jumped through the Neptune Gate, beginning our expedition against Purple Tamika's Hall of Honor. Chapter 23 until this mission, I hadn't needed precise information regarding the size, shape, and extent of the Jade League. It was going to make a great deal of difference now. In broad terms, the Jade League and Jelk Corporation touched the solar system at one of their far corners. The bulk of the League was in the direction of Rigel, while the bulk of the Corporation was in the direction of Deneb. What I hadn't realized was the extent of the unease among certain Jade League members. With the removal of the main Saurian fleets from the border regions, the old quarrels among League members had reignited. We found out that meant a lack of Jade League guardians at the jump gates nearest Jelk territory. Maybe that's another reason Baba Gobo's Starkians had been at Epsilon Indy. As nomads, they moved into power vacuums. They went where enemy warships were thinnest. We had occasion to speak with other trading crews and a few picket officers at a key jump gate. Four years ago, a league race known as the Ilk had begun an accelerated warship building program. They controlled twelve star systems behind the border region. The Ilk had long-standing grievances against the Aljanra and the Jatan. Several incidents had already taken place. Ships firing on other vessels. Maybe as telling, the Ilk had purchased large numbers of troop transports. In the worsening atmosphere, and with the removal of Lohar warships from the border, the Ilk, the Aljanra, and the Jatan had pulled the bulk of their battle cruisers from jump gate duty. Those vessels now guarded their home systems and key colony worlds. For us, it meant we had to answer a few questions at some jump gates, but that was it. Since we were a trading vessel, and a small one at that, it was clear we presented little danger to anyone. Fortunately, for the time being, the Jade League remained intact. That was important, because the pickets could have acted as pirates, hijacking the Peru and stealing our cargo. Instead, the questions directed at us implied a desire for a continuation of interstellar trade. For fifteen days we made headway toward our destination of Horus, which was deep within the Jade League. With the relocation of the Saurian fleets, we dared to use several Jelk Corporation jump gates. That allowed us to enter the League at a different angle than if we'd headed straight from the solar system. On the sixteenth day after leaving Earth, we had our first crises. The Peru jumped into the Octagon star system. On the bridge, I toweled my face with a wet rag. I'd found it the quickest way to get me thinking again after a jump. Using a clicker, I studied the system on the main screen. A bloated red giant sat in the center with three terrestrial rock balls orbiting it, making up the inner system. The outer had a single Jovian planet with swirling green cloud cover. The gas world was 100,000 kilometers from the jump gate. Starfighters, Ella said from her station. What's that? I asked. I'm picking up a trio of starfighters. Ella said. Let me give you higher magnification. She did something to her board. On the main screen, three triangular-shaped fighters leapt into view. I sat forward, squinting. 
Lohar pilots sat under bubble canopies. Each of them wore a red-crested helmet. Those are tiger fighters, Ella said. My spine turned cold. Had we jumped into a trap? Is there any indication as to their Tamika? I asked. Look, Ella said, tapping her panel. A yellow circle highlighted a red fireball beside the Lohar numbers 312 on the side of the closest fighter. I recognize the symbol, N7 said from his station. The fighters belong to Crimson Tamika. Do we know if Crimson stands with orange or with purple Tamika? I asked. Uh-oh, Ella said. This isn't good. I'm counting nine spaceships heading for us. Let me try the recognition code so I can tell you what kind of warships they are. I disliked the wait. I wanted to know now why Lohar warships headed for us on an intercept course. From my conversations with other freighter captains, I'd learned the Lohar didn't own any star systems in this region. They had fleet outposts, but most of the flotillas had abandoned them. The Peru had swung wide around the only known Lohar manned station. Two captains had spoken about the Tigers choosing sides in what appeared to be a possible civil war. The growing rumor was that Orange Tamika led a secret rebellion against the Emperor. Would the heightened tensions make our raid impossible? Maybe the brewing insurrection would keep the Emperor from Earth. I doubted it, though. It seemed the source of Dr. Sand's authority came from Holgatha and his ride on the artifact. If Felix Rex Logos could discredit Sant by annihilating us and regaining control of Holgatha, might that cause Orange Tamika's rebellion to fizzle? In the here and now, Ella looked up with worry in her eyes. What had she discovered? Four Lohar battlecruisers and five frigates are heading straight for us, Commander, she said. The ships are accelerating from a habitat orbiting the Jovian planet. I nodded, asking, Are there any more starfighters? Yes, Ella said. I'm picking up six more. Uh-oh, it looks like there's a carrier out there, Commander. There went my notion of turning around and running away through the gate before the Lohars reached our ship. Nine fighters would nail us before we could escape back the way we'd come. Give me a wide-angle view of everything, I said. In a few seconds, I studied the six new fighters. Tigers piloted them, too. I assumed the nine warships would also have Lohar crews. Turning my chair, I regarded N7. This is bigger than a picket, but much smaller than a fleet. Given our data, N7 said, I do not understand why a force of this size is out here. Commander, Ella told me, we're being hailed. She listened to her earbud. Sir, a crimson Tamika Lohar demands to speak with our captain. Put the tiger on the main screen, I said. A moment later, I faced the gaudiest Lohar I'd ever seen. He was normal-sized, which was to say seven feet tall. He wore a military cap with an ornate red badge on the bill. Crimson stripes ran up and down his black jacket. He had rows of medals on his chest. If he'd been an old-time Earther, I'd have figured him for a staff officer or a general trying to prove his manhood through the amount of tin he could pin on his chest. I never trusted such types. On the spot, I decided on some play acting. What else could I have done? Letting my shoulders deflate, I lowered my head as if awed by his presence. Great war leader, I said in Lohar. This is an amazing honor. I am too dim to withstand the glory of your presence. N7 stared at me in astonishment. You know the great tongue, the Lohar said haughtily. Yes, yes, I said, bobbing my head. It is good for trade. His magnificence scowled. Our noble tongue is used for war and to describe acts of valor. It is not used for trade. Yes, yes, I said. You are most assuredly correct. Please forgive my error. The Lohar raised an ornate baton, waving it imperiously. You will prepare your ship for boarding, 
he said. Once my flotilla reaches you, I will send inspectors to check your holds. Oh, great one, I wailed. This is not good. No, it is bad. I have a priceless cargo. I fear some of your soldiers might steal from me. The Lohar became outraged, bristling. Do you have any idea who you address? I am a terrible lack, Lord. I do not know. No, no, please forgive me. I am Senior Razor Dagon, the Lord Inspector of Crimson Tamika. You are allied with Orange Tamika, perhaps? I asked meekly. By no means, he declared. We are in league with Purple Tamika, a vile species of... He squinted at me. What is your race, traitor? I am from Alpha Centauri, Great One. You look like these humans we have come to destroy. Have you heard of Dr. Sant? Who? I asked. He is a renegade Lohar of the vilest sort, Dagon said. He tells feeble lies that ensnare the simple-minded. During his stay with them, the humans warped Sant's mind. By the species' description, you appear to be human. I gathered saliva in my mouth and spat on the floor. I despise the humans. Yes, I know about them. They're a wicked race of upstarts. No, Great One. To our bitter shame, we of Alpha Centauri resemble these filthy mongrels. I am glad you Lohars have decided to capture them all. Foolish traitor. We crusaders will annihilate the vermin. Genocide, Great One? I asked. We must cleanse these imps before they become demonic servants of the Jelk. How else can one explain their ability to warp a Lohar of the oldest house? I was beginning to see the Emperor's propaganda angle. Sant's contact with devilish humans had deranged him. Ah, I said. I had not realized humanity's crime was so grave. Yes, the Lohar said. The Emperor himself comes to sit in judgment of them. He will lead us to glorious victory over the vermin. He leads Crimson to Micah? I asked. The tiger's eyes narrowed. We have allied with Purple to Micah. That is true. Yet I wonder about you. Where did a simple trader come to learn about the Lohars in such detail? On my chair I cringed before him. Please, my lord, all know about the mighty Lohars. You are a valorous race, defending the artifacts with your blood. He nodded, but still seemed suspicious. I had to distract him with something else. What could I say, though? Then I thought I had it. I see your medals, Lord. You must have an amazing war record. His eyes narrowed even more tightly than before. I understand your tactic. Flattery will not help you, traitor. We are guarding the League from all possible contact with the Earthlings. Prepare your ship for boarding. My soldiers will search your cargo and check your logs, ensuring you have not secretly aided the targeted savages. Please, Great One, have mercy on me, a traitor. I fear your soldiers will pilfer my rich goods. Perhaps if you came yourself, Lord. I felt N7 watching me closely. I would gladly honor your visit by gifting you with precious gems from my rarest collection, I said. From Ra's claw, Ella had learned about the Lohar's love of jewelry. I was testing that lust. Senior Razor Dagon, the Lord Inspector of Crimson Tamika, regarded me closely. A crafty smile slid across his face. Yes, I think I shall make this a personal inspection, the tiger said. 
You will, of course, as a matter of protocol, send your highest-ranking officers aboard my flagship. But of course, Great One. We will honor you in whatever way you deem necessary. We will make the exchange in three hours, the Lohar said. I smiled in the oiliest manner I could summon. Then the screen went blank as he broke contact. I do not understand, Commander, N7 asked. Once the Crimson Lord Inspector boards our ship, he will realize you're human. Then he will kill all of us. Tell Dimitri and Rollo they're going over to the Tiger flagship, I said. What are you thinking, Creed? Ella asked me. I glanced back at N7 before studying Ella. We're going to have to work fast, I said. You brought the Jelk mine probe, right? What? Ella said. I don't know what you have in mind. I would need hours to prep him and study his psychology before I could begin to tamper with his mind. That is what you're thinking, isn't it? That's right, I said. We'll subdue him once he's on board and put him under the machine. You'll have ten minutes to condition him. Didn't you just hear me? Ella asked. I did. That's why I'm telling you that you have ten minutes. That will be long enough to scramble his brains, nothing more, she said. If you don't succeed, I said, Dimitri and Rollo will die, along with all of us, under Lohar lasers. That will mean the Lohars win the crusade against Earth. This is a rash plan, Ella said. I spread my hands. Under the circumstances, I don't see what else I can do. Senior Razor Dagon strikes me as an arrogant pretender. Our only hope is to get him to come aboard ship where we can condition him. At least we knew they loved gems, so we were able to entice him with a bribe. I am surprised he is so foolish, N7 said. I'm not, Ella said. He has all the warships. He knows he can order our destruction with a snap of his fingers. Such a situation often makes humans overconfident. Creed's guess was to believe it would do the same thing for Lohars. We don't have him yet, I said. So let's get ready. Three hours later, I shook Rollo and Dimitri's hands before watching them enter a hatch. They would board a three-man flyer and head to the Lohar flagship. I wondered if I'd ever see either of them again. I hadn't expected anything like this. The Emperor had moved quicker than I'd thought he would. It appeared that he had ordered a blockade around our region of space. It seemed like a wide and rather porous net. I wondered on the Emperor's reasoning. I knew too little regarding the many factors an Emperor would have to take into account for his crusade. Maybe the wide blockade had more to do with halting the efforts of Orange to Mica than catching humans. Maybe catching humans was simply a pretext for the flotilla being here. That made more sense. Whatever the real reason for the warships, it showed me that at least one other Tamika had joined the crusade. It showed, too, the Emperor had kept good on his threat. He meant to wipe us out. Standing in the reception area, I exhaled. Zoe and Ella waited with me. I hope you know what you're doing, Creed, Ella said. Don't I always? I asked. Ella snorted softly. On a hand monitor, I noticed the arrival of the Lord Inspector Senior Razor Dagon. He came in a rakish shuttle with several starfighters flying guard. The procession reminded me of a parade more than a military exercise. Soon, outer locks clanged and pressure gauges hissed. Remember, I said, we're traitors. That means we cringe and act awed toward them. I just want to kill, Zoe said. Finesse, I said. It's all about finesse. I like that coming from you, Ella said. Good. A louder hiss told me it was time. I straightened, pasting a fake smile onto my face. I wore a red silk shirt, fluffy green pants, a green cape, and boots. It made me feel like a Christmas ornament. The hatch opened and three big Lohar guards stepped forth. They wore body armor but lacked exoskeleton strength. Good. They underestimated us. Each guard cradled a big machine gun, looking as if he wanted to unload his weapon into our bodies. 
Another impressive Lohar stepped up. He wore gaudy red garments and swept the floor with a broom. The last Lohar appeared, Senior Razor Dagon. His fur had good color, but he stooped. That meant he was older than I'd realized. I suspected the Lord Inspector used fur coloring. Stepping forward, I went to one knee, bowing my head. You are the traitor? Senior Razor Dagon asked. I am, Lord. Rise, he said. Show me to your storeroom and these precious gems you spoke so highly about. I am eager to select my gift. I stood, keeping my head bowed before him. Would you like to see the rest of the vessel first, Lord? No, he said, sounding irritated. I told you my desire, now attend to it. Yes, great lord, I obey. Turning, I swirled the cape and pointed at Ella. Hurry, wench, open the hatch for the mighty Lohar of Crimson Tamika. Struggling to keep from rolling her eyes, Ella tugged the hatch open. I strode through. Next, the three guards followed, the other with his swishing broom, and finally Senior Razor Dagon. As he moved through the corridor, the Chief Lohar sniffed aloud. I detect a taint of oil in the air, he said. On the outside, this looked like a new vessel. Within, I am displeased at the state of the recycling unit. I will beat the Chief Engineer, Lord. Of this I assure you. Never mind about that, he said. Let's hurry to your storeroom. I took them on a long walk through the corridors. As I'd guessed, the Chief Lohar wasn't in as good a condition as the guards. Soon he panted. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him open his snout to complain about the length of our trek. We're almost there, Lord, I said. Senior Razor Dagon nodded brusquely. There, wench, I said, pointing at the selected hatch. Hurry, open it for his magnificence. Ella opened the hatch. Out of the way, I said, pushing her onto the deck plates. This way, Lord. This is the inner sanctum of gems. I jumped through. The three Lohar guards followed, each of them ducking his head. I spun around, having slipped a sap from my pants pocket and into my right hand. As the first guard straightened, I swung. The sap connected against his forehead. He dropped hard onto the deck. The second guard I caught under the chin. His fangs clicked together, his head lifting. On the next swing, the sap caught him on the left temple, and he, too, dropped onto the deck plates. The last guard got off a single shot. The bullet smashed against a bulkhead. I swung. He blocked with his rifle, catching my forearm. With a yell, my forearm bone throbbed, I ducked. He swung with the butt of his machine gun. The hard wood swished over me. Charging him, I hit his midsection with my shoulder and hammered his back against a wall. He grunted, dropped his weapon, and struck my head with the bottom of his fists. That staggered me, so I stumbled away from him. The guard growled, picking up his fallen machine gun. I hurled the sap. It hit his face and gave me a moment's grace. I whipped out a force blade and thrust. The powered knife hissed as it cut through armor and buried into his chest. Blood jetted from the wound and he gagged on the gore bubbling in his mouth. I barely moved aside fast enough to escape most of the blood and his falling body that thudded onto the deck. I found myself staring into the eyes of Senior Razor Dagon. Ella had taken down the sweeper. You're mad, the tiger said in a hoarse voice. All of you are as good as dead. First flicking off the force blade, I jumped through the hatch and wrestled the old Lohar around. Unhand me, he demanded. He'd have been better off fighting instead of jabbering. In seconds, I had his arms pinned behind him. Ella snapped plastic ties onto his wrists. Forcing his head down, I pushed him into the room with his deceased guards. You are dead, he said. You're all as good as dead. Give me a hand, I told Zoe. 
She rushed in. Together we manhandled the protesting Lohar into a chair, strapping him into place, immobilizing his head with steel bands. This will never work, Ella told me. She slid a lead curtain out of the way, revealing the refrigerator-sized jelk machine. What is that? Senior Razor Dagon asked. He was stretched out belly first like a pinned butterfly in a boy's collection, with his chin resting in a groove. With a grunt, Ella rolled the machine closer. Then she opened a slot and took out the lampshade-shaped focusing device. Fiddling with it, she aligned it with the tiger's forehead. You aren't from Alpha Centauri, are you? Dagon asked. Don't answer him, Ella said. It will only make this more difficult. She clicked on the device. The main machine hummed with an obscene sound. A light appeared between the tiger's eyes. She adjusted the dot of light. He's right about one thing, Ella said. This is madness. I backed away, pulling Zoe with me. Once outside the room, I shut the hatch. You killed the Lohar guards, Zoe whispered. I didn't want to. It can't work now, can it? She asked. Dagon will have to go back without his guards. How can he explain that to his officers so we're not blasted out of space? I looked into Zoe's eyes. Give it a little while and we'll find out. Fifteen minutes later, the hatch opened. Through the opening, a dazed-looking senior Razor Dagon peered quizzically at me. Hello, he said. Don't speak to him, Ella said from out of sight. Senior Razor Dagon cocked his tiger head. He appeared more confused than before. Get out of his way, Ella said. I backed against a bulkhead. Zoe did likewise. Aren't you going to speak to me? Senior Razor Dagon asked. I stared at the floor. A moment later, the tiger stepped through the hatch. I must return to my ship, he said to no one in particular. Ella appeared behind him. She looked haggard but determined. She didn't say anything more. Slowly at first, the crimson to Micah Lohar headed back the way he'd come. When he turned the wrong way, Ella called out to him. The Lohar stopped. In slow motion, he faced her. Commander Creed? Ella said. Show the great lord the way. A moment, the tiger said. Glancing at Ella, I saw her nod. Therefore, I faced the Lohar. You are the notorious animal, Commander Creed, he asked. Don't answer that, Ella warned. I expected Senior Razor Dagon to glance at her. He did not. Instead, the most puzzled expression of all appeared on his furry face. Finally, he motioned for me to walk ahead of him. I did, all the way to the exit. He donned his spacesuit. Without a word goodbye, he entered the airlock and closed the hatch. I whirled around to Ella. What did you tell him? I asked. A form of the truth is always the easiest to sell, she said. I told him this ship carries the notorious Commander Creed. We're on a secret mission in regards to the Crusade. That's a big risk. Do you think so? Ella asked. I didn't like the look in her eyes. She seemed frazzled. What about his dead guards? I asked. How was he going to explain them and the sweeper? They're to remain here and ensure our success, Ella said. Do you think the jilt conditioning will hold once he's back on his flagship? I give that a fifty percent chance of success, she told me. I thought about that. Well, it's better than what we had when he first hailed us. All right, you two did well. Let's get back to the bridge. Like many of these affairs, the ending proved anticlimactic. Ten minutes after returning to his flagship, Senior Razor Dagon sent Rollo and Dimitri back. Twenty minutes after his return, the Lohar hailed our ship. He spoke to Ella. Do you require an escort to the next jump gate? he asked. 
No, Ella said. You must treat us as a regular trader. That will arouse the least suspicions regarding us. I understand, he said. And yet, it feels as if I'm forgetting something vital. Don't you remember? Ella asked. The Emperor himself will reward you once this is over. Ah, he said. Good. This is good. Goodbye, and may the Great Maker bless your enterprise. Ella nodded. The screen went blank. I sucked in air several times before I managed to say, Head for the next jump gate at full acceleration. I want to get the hell out of this star system as fast as we can. Chapter 24 It would have been so much easier if Holgatha had simply transferred us to the planet Horus. We could have completed the mission already and returned home to drink beer. Instead, the days merged into weeks. The farther we left the border region behind, the easier the receptions became toward us. Once we left Ilk territory far behind, it became like moving through the old United States. A few border guards asked a question at some crossings. At others, the sign told us we entered a new state. Finally, the weeks merged into a month and a half. Shipboard life had become monotonous. We drilled to remain sharp, but I believe we lost some of our skills. This wasn't like the attack upon the portal planet. We'd had space on the Lohar Dreadnought. The Peru proved cramped, and I began to wonder if I should have brought half the number of troopers along. The sheer size of the Jade League began to dawn on me. It was one thing to study a star chart. It was another to actually make jump after jump, heading ever deeper into League territory. The extent of the League and the number of different races caused me to wonder why the aliens cared so much about Earth. How had an emperor come to worry what the Jelt did with us? In ancient times, had our ancestors been active in space? Was there some terrible lingering memory that propelled the aliens against us? I've always thought it strange how human history just appeared almost full-blown onto the scene. The greatest culprit in that regard had been ancient Egypt. Even the early pharaohs had pyramids, while the culture had math, skull-drilling medicine, all kinds of technology, including batteries. It seemed as if everything had simply leapt from Horace's brow full-grown instead of painfully climbing through stages. I happen to remember that some of the earliest Ur had roomier and richer houses than later Ur. That's what archaeologists had dug up. It meant the first ones on the scene had been wealthier than the latter. Just like in ancient Egypt, Sumer also seemed to have simply begun with a high culture, as if the people were colonists from a different time and place. Could the story of Noah and the Flood, Gilgamesh and the Deluge, have cosmic implications? Maybe old Noah had been a spacefarer kicked out of the void. Maybe the aliens had conveniently forgotten to tell us the true history of humanity. Then it would make sense why human history just seemed to pop up with advanced technology. Why did recorded history only date back to around 4,000 B.C.? I'm not talking about prehistoric times, but written historical events. If modern Homo sapiens had been around for 100,000 years, as some of my teachers had thought, you'd expect to find ancient civilizations 50,000 years old, 30,000. No, it never worked out like that. Around 4,000 B.C., everything seemed to appear as if with the snap of someone's fingers. Was that when the other aliens had driven humanity from the stars? I had no idea. But the size of the Jade League daunted me. Why would an emperor start a crusade to wipe us out? Why not just bring several hundred warships and get the job over with? Why make such a production out of it? Even after eight years in space, I knew far too little concerning the aliens, the forerunners and their artifacts, and our place in all of this. After seven weeks of travel, armed pickets began to appear again at the jump gates. We were stopped twice, endured inspections and hard questioning. I asked several trader captains about that. Their hints implied what I suspected. 
We passed Lohar worlds now, and tigers were busy choosing sides for what appeared to be a brewing civil war. On the ninth week after our encounter with Senior Razor Dagon, we neared Horus. Then we finally had a breakthrough in a critical area. I shot pool with Dimitri. Let me rephrase that. I stood beside the pool table with a stick in hand, watching Dimitri school me on the game. Ella walked through the hatch. Crack, Dimitri shot, and I heard another billiard ball drop into a pocket. I'd hoped her appearance might have disrupted his concentration. No such luck. Ella, Dimitri said as he walked around the table. Dimitri, she said before giving me a significant glance. Is there a problem? I asked. We're a day out from the second to last jump gate, she said. Uh-huh, I said, watching Dimitri sink another ball. N7 finally hacked a planetary data core, she said. What? I asked. The packet didn't self-erase? No, she said. I put up my pool stick. That finally got Dimitri's attention. Where are you going? he asked, looking up. Didn't you hear Ella? I asked. He shook his head. Two more jumps and we're at Horus. We already know that, Dimitri said, shrugging. That still gives us plenty of time to finish the game. Not me, I said. N7 finally hacked the data core. It's time to plan. After the game, yes? Dimitri asked. Go, I told Ella, making shooing motions. She raised an eyebrow. I made urgent shooing motions. Finally, she headed out of the hatch. I followed as Dimitri cracked another billiard ball. What was that all about? She asked. I'm tired of watching him win all the time. Ella rolled her eyes and continued down the corridor. Humanity's future is at stake and you're worried about losing another game of pool? The way she put it, that sounded childish. Just once, though, I would have liked to beat Dimitri. Ten minutes later, I stood with Ella in the chart room. N7 had hacked something called a Jade League Catalog of Planets and Customs. In essence, we googled the information from a hijacked alien computer core. If some are wondering why, after eight years, we had so little interstellar information on the Jade League, the answer was simple. In many ways, the Lohars ran the League just as the Soviets had run the Russian Empire called the USSR. In those days, good maps had been the next thing to state secrets. We'd been having a bear of a time getting real data on the inner Lohar worlds. Ella and I used separate readers, ingesting the information. Twenty minutes later, N7 showed up. Our android began to speed-read files. We discovered a few interesting facts about Horus and its star system. It possessed a G-class star with a single planet. There were no asteroids, meteors, comets, nothing. Just the planet and its star. Despite its being a swamp world, the planet had desert poles with huge cracks in the rocky surface. Hot oceans separated the poles from the central continent. There, life thrived in marshy abundance. Steam rose constantly and thick fogs drifted everywhere. A high mountain range provided the living area for the Lohars. In that region grew giant trees and large predatory snakes. The compendium didn't say why Purple Tomica had chosen Horus as their shrine planet. I would have dearly liked to know. A single short entry suggested the Shi Feng used Horus as a training center. I set down my reader. Hadn't Dr. Sant told me no one spoke about the Shi Feng? Why did this data chip have information about them then? Shrugging, I stretched my back and continued reading. The planet lacked mineral resources, manufacturing centers, and did not appear to produce art of any kind. So what good was it? Maybe it used to be a prison planet, Ella said. Long ago, the elders of Purple Tamika were exiled on the mountains. They rose up and came back to win the Empire. Hence, they turned Horus into a shrine planet. Maybe, I said. I have a different theory, N7 said. The planet appears to have religious significance. 
How do you know that? I asked. N7 tapped his reader. I just read about an ancient forerunner city. Eons ago, it sank into the world ocean. Ah, Ella said. It appears they have an Atlantis myth. This is interesting. Pardon? N7 asked her. Forget about Atlantis, I said. What about this sunken city? N7 blinked twice before continuing. Purple Tamika excavates the underwater city, yet the procedure is perilous. Water monsters constantly attack the submarines. Underwater volcanoes spew hot mud and ash on the finds. Still, the priests search through the watery ruins for clues to the first ones. Okay, I said. Horus appears to be a religious shrine planet. I seem to recall Shaw Cloth talking about a shrine planet before. You refer to the Sigma Draconis system, N7 said. Shaw Cloth and his brethren wanted something from the planetary shrine. That is why we attacked the planetary defense station. That's old news, I said. I want to know where this Hall of Honor is located. Have you found out yet? N7 pointed at a screen chart. It showed the small habitable area on the central mountain plateau. The hall lies in the city of Zalambra, he said. It is the largest metropolitan center on Horus, complete with a spaceport. Give me a magnification of Zalambra, I said. N7 did, showing us a dismal place. Mist drifted over wide canals, crisscrossing a city built of log cabins, log palaces, and log stadiums. Big motorized dugout canoes traversed the waterways as they used to in Venice, Italy. Seems primitive for a spacefaring race, I said. Since Purple Tamika could presumably build any type of city they desired, Ella said, we can surmise they raised Zalambra this way for a reason. Sure, I said. It's still primitive. That might make sense for a religious center, she said. No. I said. The Forerunner City is underwater in the ocean, not perched in the mountains. Zalambra houses the Hall of Honor. That's not religious. Maybe the two are related, Ella said. Maybe honor is part of their religion. Whatever, I said. In the end, it doesn't matter for our strike. What are their orbital defenses like? Have you found anything about that? The compendium did not specify the planetary defenses, N7 said. With my elbows on a table, I bent my head, rubbing my temples. It's strange when you think about it. We've come all this way to hit them in the heart, and the planet turns out to be a primitive place stuck in a swamp. It is Purple Tamika's origin point, N7 said. Clearly they wish to preserve it in its original state. Well, parts of it are primitive, I said. The oceanography shows us they're willing to use modern technology to search the ancient city. That is an astute observation, N7 said. Yeah, I said. Well, it looks like we'll have to wait to make our final plans until we see how well they guard the planet. Another three days should bring us to Horus, Ella said. I stared at the orbital shot of the log city. It must have been taken on one of the rare clear days. Clouds normally covered every inch of the planet. It was strange. The Emperor brought a crusading armada against the poisoned Earth. Many hundreds of light years away, we readied to strike a primitive swamp world. If we won here, could we get back home in time to stop the Emperor? I had no idea. I just knew I was going to try with everything I had. That sleep period on my cot, I wondered just how sacred these shrine planets were to the Lohars and to the other Jade League members. The aliens had formed their league to halt the depredations of the Jelk Corporation. The League races protected the artifacts. I'd been with Cloth when he attacked a shrine planet at the Sigma Draconis system. The Jelk fixation on the planetary shrine had helped to give us assault troopers time to make our play for freedom. The historical Vikings had struck at Christian monasteries in the Dark Ages. A 
Among the Christian princes and kings of England, France, and Germany, such places were held in reverence. The Viking raids against the church had shocked the Christians of that era. Since the Vikings had originally been pagans worshipping Odin and Thor, they hadn't given a fig about insulting God or Christ. How would the Jade League races react to our attack against the Purple Tamika Hall of Honor? Would it outrage the Lohars? Would it outrage other aliens to such an extent that they would unite even more vigorously against humanity? I had no idea. If we were lucky, the Lohars would guard their Hall of Honor with as much force as the medieval Christians had originally guarded the monasteries, which was to say, not at all. We were the Star Vikings, and we planned to hit Purple Tamika where it hurt the most. Chapter 25 Coming out of the Horus Jump Gate, we found ourselves half a million kilometers from the planet. A picket ship, twice the size of the Achilles, hidden in the belly of the Peru, moved leisurely toward us. His particle beam cannons are activating, Ella told me. Hail the ship, I said. Ella did so, finally saying, He wants to know why we're here. Can you put the speaker on the screen? He won't agree to that, Ella told me. Says it is against Horus custom. Tell him we're gem traders. We had a good season of trade. In order to show our appreciation, we are going to place our three best gems in the planetary shrine. Ella relayed the message. Putting a forefinger onto her earbud, she listened to his reply. Finally, she told me, He likes your story, Commander. The particle beam cannons have gone offline. We're to proceed to the planet. Is he giving us an escort? I asked. Negative, Commander. I imagine he trusts us. I eyed Ella, wondering if that was supposed to be a barb. In any case, the Peru headed for the planet. It soon became apparent that many spaceships orbited Horus, more than we'd expected. I'm counting three hundred spacecraft all told, Ella said. Are they all military vessels? I asked. No. Traders, what I take to be yachts, system craft, escort vehicles, and a few large battle cruisers and carriers. I exhaled sharply, watching the screen, studying the strange world. The desert poles with their visible cracks reminded me of the old Martian canals. There weren't any on the red planet, but in the good old days people thought Mars did have canals. Some of the oldest pictures showing the planet had them, with artists having penciled them in. Now I viewed a world that seemed to have a massive drainage system. The more things changed, the more they stayed the same. For the next several hours, the Peru headed for Horus. Ella began picking out the orbitals. They were ugly constructs with heavy armor and big plasma cannons. The Lohar meant to protect this world. Soon enough, the largest space station hailed us. The operator gave us a flight schedule to bring us into low orbit. Horus might have old-fashioned log cities, but there was nothing ancient or decrepit about the planetary defenses. Too soon, the Peru braked. In another three hours, we would be in orbit. Do you still think we can do this? Ella asked me. It doesn't matter what I think. We're going to try. Ella nodded. I stood. I'm going to get ready. Good luck, Commander, she said. Nodding tersely, I stalked off the bridge. As such things went, the Peru was a small trader, well able to land on a gravity surface. Ella asked the space station commander for permission to land at Zalambra's spaceport. The operator told her we would have to wait several days. Health inspectors would have to board the ship first and clear us. By now we knew regular Lohar customs and had expected this. Fortunately, we had ten stealth pods. They were military-grade insertion devices stolen from Sonicot. Made for bigger and heavier Lohar maniples that gave each Arban enough space to bring their DZ-9 air cycles. The Peru orbited Horus five times before Zoe brought the Achilles out of the transport's belly. The patrol boat's sides showed Lohar lettering. The vessel's computer held purple Tamika codes from Sonicot. 
We'd been saving that, along with a trick I'd learned in hyperspace from Shaw Cloth. The two ships orbited side by side in order to show one radar signature. Finally, zero hour approached. It was night in swampy Zalambra, with first light still hours away. One by one, we maneuvered the stealth pods out of the Peru's cargo hold and into space. In low orbit over Horus, Star Vikings using thruster packs glided their air cycles into the drop pods. Soon it was my turn. I secured my DZ-9 to a rack and then settled into one myself. I wore my symbiotic skin and carried my bangkuv along with a Lohar machine gun and a satchel of sonic grenades. N7 in his cyber armor sat webbed in at the drop pod's controls. Ready, Commander? The android asked me. What does Zoe say? I asked. Everyone is in position, Commander. My gut tightened into a tiny ball, squeezing harder and harder. Man, I had to go to the head and take a piss. My stomach seethed and I found myself trembling with anticipation. I had a bitter surprise for the tigers. Not only would we act like star vikings, but the worst sort of vandals, which seemed just in a way. The word came from an old German tribe called vandals. In the bad old days of the failing Roman Empire, they had raided the borders. Eventually, the vandals crossed into Spain and forded the Strait of Gibraltar into North Africa. There, they marched on the Roman city of Carthage. They took it and became the worst sort of pirates, the Vikings of their age. Anyway, a day came when their greatest king, a man named Geyseric, sailed upon Rome and sacked it. His warriors looted in such a thorough and savage fashion that people coined the phrase, looting like vandals. In time, the word vandal came to mean wanton destruction. I planned on some wanton destruction down on Horus, but for a tactical reason. Maybe future generations would curse me, but I didn't care. I wanted to save humanity, and for that I would do just about anything. I didn't give a damn if the Horus Tigers had to pay for what other Lohars had done to Earth. They should have left us alone. That's all I care to say about that. Let's do this, I told N7. Let's show the purple Lohars that payback is a bitch. The stealth drop reminded me of my days with the Jelk Corporation in one particular. We couldn't see a thing going on. With cold jets of propulsion so we didn't give ourselves away with a heat signature, the black drop pod maneuvered for the atmosphere. Internal anti-gravity chutes whined inside the pod. The plunging sensation reminded me of Great America as a kid. I'd ridden the drop zone hundreds of times. The ride had gone straight up, then it released and you dropped straight down. Maybe it wouldn't have been as bad in the pod if I could have seen outside. Around me, assault troopers groaned. Others clenched their teeth. We fell and fell toward Horus. Time lost meaning. The plunge seemed to go on forever. Then with a lurch, the dropping sensation departed. We floated, and the high whining inside the pod ceased. A ragged cheer went up from the troopers. Has anyone spotted us? I asked N7. No radar has touched the outer surface, he said, with his face pressed against the viewplate. That brought another cheer. The minutes ticked by. Finally, N7 said, Landing in thirty seconds. As desired, we're headed for a vast body of water. I waited, and the stealth pod struck the surface. That caused the entire structure to tremble. One air cycle fell out of its restraints and hit the deck with a crash and raining of parts. The entire compartment surged upward as if carried by a huge swell. There are waves, N7 said needlessly. The sides will blow away in three, two, one. A sudden shudder caused the sides of the stealth pod to explode outward. I watched one big piece tumble end over end. One hundred meters away, it struck the dark waters with a splash. At the same time, a wave rolled into our compartment, soaking three troopers. Get on your cycles, I shouted. Start them up. Get airborne. 
I yanked the release cord and guided my DZ-9 in a controlled descent onto the sloshing deck. The entire pod had already begun to sink. More waves rolled toward us. With a jump, I crashed onto the saddle. My thumb pushed the starter. Nothing happened. Around me, other cycles sputtered into mechanical life. The waves seemed to get bigger and faster the longer we were in the water. I shoved my thumb against the starter and told the cycle some choice words. That must have done it. My air mount hummed with sound. I twisted the throttle and the machine rose just in time to avoid the wave. Unfortunately, two troopers failed to do what the rest of us had. The wave catapulted a DZ-9 over the deck and into the soup. It plopped out of sight, sinking. The other cycle slid for the edge, but the trooper grabbed it. Using steroid-68 strength magnified by her symbiotic armor, she stopped the machine from reaching the ocean. Straddling the bike, she started it and rose into the air. The Arbon leader shouted orders. An air cycle dipped low and the stranded trooper climbed aboard as a passenger. Around us in the storm-tossed sea were other stealth pods. From them rose the wasp-like Star Vikings. In all, ninety-three DZ-9s made it. Only one trooper drowned. Rollo, I radioed. I know what to do, he said. Gunning his air cycle and taking three other troopers with him, Rollo headed for the underwater excavation. Between them, in a mesh net, the machines carried a present for the Tigers. It was part of our escape plan. The other ninety cycles hummed as we sped low over the water toward the mountains in the far distance. On one of those plateaus was the city of Zalambra and the selected Hall of Honor. We'd made the space drop. Now it was time to see if we could hit the city before anyone knew humans were on Horus's surface. This strike was different from Sonicot in a number of ways. The biggest difference was the need to travel 300 kilometers before we struck the first blow. I led the pack, an air cycle gang from Earth. The image made me grin for 30 kilometers. Opening the throttle, I flew until my craft shuddered. Below, the ocean whizzed past. Soon we hit a sandy beach climbed above plants that looked like palm trees and made the cycles throb with strain as we rode up steep slopes. It was dark, and thick cloud cover meant no stars. We passed monsters the size of city blocks, slow-moving slug creatures. Lava pits roared with flame fifty meters tall. Darting bat things swooped at me like gnats. Two struck my suit, flopping away as each gave their death screech. Stupid bats. Slow it down, I ordered. We were forty kilometers from Zalambra. Forest time, it must have been two o'clock in the morning. Dense cloud cover protected the surface from the star's harsh radiation. This system's sun gave off more bad rays than Earth's did. The DZ-9 skimmed a swamp. I saw the scummy water ripple. Once, giant coils like a Loch Ness monster spun into sight and disappeared just as fast. Snakes, Dimitri said. I hate snakes. I smiled. The Cossack loved old movies and repeating his favorite lines from them. No mercy, I reminded my bikers. Kill anyone getting in the way. This is one raid that must succeed. No one argued. Everyone knew the score. Still, I felt it was good to remind them. The last ten kilometers showed farmland and bizarre structures. The latter reminded me of the funky statues I used to see on American college campuses. I know, I'm a philistine when it comes to art. I had a simple rule of thumb. Anything I could do wasn't art. I could fling paint on a canvas. I could twist girders and cement them into the ground. I couldn't paint like Rembrandt or chisel marble and make it look like a beautiful naked lady. Those things were art. The crap at the end had been the ugliness that the last American upper class had shoveled onto the rest of us and called it beauty. It seemed like the purple to Michael Lohars had the same mental disease. I gripped my handlebars. On my HUD, the dark log city rose into view. Well, rose might be the wrong word. 
It appeared as a cold, sleepy town with a few of the bizarre artwork statues thrown in. In the center of town was the biggest log palace that I'd ever seen. If I had to compare it to anything, it would have been the Kremlin in Moscow. The Russians had known how to build with wood. They had those crazy domes and cool spires. Sadly, these days, Moscow was a radioactive crater. I grabbed a sonic grenade from my pouch. Activating it with my thumb, I dropped it onto the first street. Other Star Vikings did likewise. Our helmets would stop the debilitating and, in some instances, killing noise. As the DZ-9s buzzed Zalambra, we dropped our tiny bundles on a clearly unsuspecting metropolitan suburb. Dimitri, now, I said. The Cossack ordered his arbons. Almost immediately, missiles roared from under the belly of selected cycles. The small rockets hissed with hellish speed and blasted against the Hall of Honor. Explosions rocked the log palace. Wood shot into the air. Flames jetted. Fires blazed into existence. More missiles struck. Tiger guards appeared on untouched wooden parapets. They wore absurd plumed helmets and hefted long sticks with blades on the end. This was getting better and better. They must have been ceremonial guards. With my bankuv, I shot one of them in the chest. The lohar crumpled around the beam, with his fur smoking. Another I pierced in the head, which vanished under the hot laser. Then I dropped the rifle and used both hands. I flew through an exploded opening into the Hall of Honors. Before me flashed the ancient prizes Ra's Claw had described. Standing up as if riding a jet ski, I skidded across the floor until I reached a blazing fire. Tigers roared, shouting what sounded like obscenities. Were these the Vestals? They didn't have weapons, but they did charge with their claws extended. I thought about my dad. He'd never had a chance against the Lohar Dreadnought. Yeah, everyone wants war to be fair and honorable. It never has been and it never will be. That's just my opinion, for what it's worth. With a Lohar machine gun, I put every tiger on his back. Blood and guts blew everywhere. I'm a savage. I'm an earther. I'm not making excuses. I'm not proud of what I did to them. Could I have done it another way? Yeah, if I'd been thinking more clearly, I might have used another sonic grenade. I didn't, though. I got off my cycle and slaughtered them. Then I proceeded to beat out the fire. Why would any tiger care about these flames? Rosclaw had told us about the eternal fire of Purple Tamika. An old Lohar prophecy said that if it ever went out, that would be the end of the tribe. Well, I beat out the fire except for one precious coal. Three troopers ran near with a hot box. Using tongs, I grabbed the last coal and dumped it into the container. A different trooper put in the special tinder for the coal. Great stacks of wood lay nearby. In the box was the last of their eternal fire. If Purple Tamika wanted it back, they were going to have to be nice to me. Go, I told the three. Take the fire and guard it with your lives. They raced back to their humming cycles on the floor. I rotated in a slow circle, watching my people at work. Dead lohars lay everywhere. We ripped tapestries off the walls. Those were made from the fur of kings and emperors. Ancient tiger armor tumbled into our carrying carts. Swords, knives, kick boots filled our boxes. Black blood, skulls, and banners twelve thousand years old fell into special sacks. Smooth gold coins and stone talismans clattered against each other. Lohar military or religious police are on their way, Dimitri radioed me. I ran to my air cycle, lifted and shot through an exploded opening. With five other Star Vikings, I flew at lights bobbing along the widest canal. Big log boats with mounted weapons sped toward the middle of Zalambra. No, you don't, I said. Follow me, I told the troopers. I flew down their throats. I mean straight at those mounted weapons. There wasn't any swerving or darting. Locking the direction of my cycle, I stood and blazed away with the Lohar machine gun. Tigers tumbled from the dugouts. 
A red beam from one of the boat cannons hit a cycle. The DZ-9 exploded in a fiery blast. A helmet hissed past me. It carried the head of a dead Star Viking. The machine gun trembled in my hands as I hammered tigers and their boats. Bloody chunks mingled with smoking wood. Then everything went crazy as two red beams struck my cycle. They chewed metal and I immediately began to drop. With a bellow of rage, I leapt for my DZ-9. Luckily for me, I struck water. I plummeted and hit bottom almost right away. Using my legs and the enhanced power of the symbiotic suit, I leapt again, this time for the surface. My head broke the surface with big dugout canoes all around me. Blades slashed at my helmet. Several struck like gongs, making my ears ring. It's hard to remember exactly what happened next. In a red haze, I recall grabbing a pole and yanking myself toward the surprised tiger. He braced his feet to keep from tumbling into the water. For his sake and that of his fellow guards, he would have been better off letting go of his pole. Like a monster from a swampy lagoon, I climbed into his dugout. Tearing the halberd thing from a lohar, I hacked with demented strength. They roared and rushed me. I mowed them down because I had a pure heart and wore living skin of jelk design. When I cleared the first dugout, I leapt, rocking the next as I landed. With fury, I chopped furry bodies. For as long as I lived, I planned to kill and destroy the enemies of Earth. Even with the symbiotic suit, I began to grow weary after the third dugout. The skin had taken cuts and oozed, attempting to heal. A red beam slashed past me. That revitalized my energies. I dove, hiding on the bottom of the boat, crawling for the front of the craft. I never made it. Using beams, the tigers sawed and hacked my dugout. Instead of dying to their weapon mounts, I slithered overboard, sinking into the murky water. Aiming my visor toward the surface, I used my HUD to make out the dugout bottoms. Some of the fury departed my brain as I stood down there. I recalled my sonic grenades and the force blade at my side. Right, I knew how to play this. With a leap and a bellow inside my helmet, I shot up, latched a hand onto a gunwale, and pulled myself aboard a new dugout. Tigers roared and hacked. My suit had hardened and fended off the first round of blows. Before the second cut my living skin, I rolled a sonic grenade onto the sloshing bottom. It must have gone off. The tigers dropped, with blood pouring out of their ears. Some clapped their paws over their ears and dove overboard. I stood and began lobbing sonic grenades into other dugouts. Soon I stood alone, bobbing in the canal. On shore, the big hall of honors burned nicely. I watched with professional appreciation and saw air cycles burst out like a swarm of bees. They flew for the ocean. I waved to them, and I would have used my helmet's radio to call... Unfortunately, it had shorted out. Must have happened because of all those halberd slashes to the head. I breathed deeply. How long would it be until the tigers brought power-armored soldiers to take me down? I shrugged. Then I noticed three cycles skimming the water. I waved again, more vigorously than before. One of the riders must have seen me. He turned, and in less than thirty seconds he hovered just above my head. Gratefully, I climbed onto Dimitri's cycle. The Cossack hadn't given up on me. I owed my friend big time. Slapping him on the back, I let him know I was okay. He gave me the thumbs up. Then Dimitri gunned his DZ-9, heading out of Zalambra with our sacred loot. We'd made it in. Always the easier part of a raid or an assassination. Getting out alive was going to be the challenge. Chapter 26 As Dimitri drove, I worked on my helmet radio. When we flew over the sandy beach, I finally managed to reconnect by using a secondary emergency pack. N7 had already arranged the timing with Ella upstairs in the Achilles. I confirmed that everyone was ready. The orbitals have gone onto high alert, Ella told me. 
It's time for our surprise, then, I said. Are you sure you want to do this, Creed? She asked. I didn't mind that she used my name on the radio. Let the purple Tamika Lohars know I'd done this. Let them crap their drawers over me. I'm sure, I said. Do it. Roger, Ella said. I waited behind Dimitri. He skimmed over the dark waves. Around me, the Star Vikings flew in a tight formation. After another thirty kilometers, I swear I felt a shudder coming from the planet. That was impossible, of course. First, I was airborne. Second, how could Horus tremble? Then I saw it. My heart went cold. Far out on the watery horizon, a giant mushroom cloud rose higher and higher. I swallowed uneasily. Had I done the right thing? I had a feeling I'd have to pay for giving this order. Maybe not right away, but some day. At my orders, Rollo and his team had carried a hellburner, dropping it over the ancient forerunner city. The fantastically powerful explosive must have sunk onto the sea bottom before igniting. Could the blast have made the planet rumble? No. It must have been a guilty subconscious on my part. I destroyed a great archaeological dig. The site had held history from the beginning. Ruins from the fabled first ones. What did I care, right? Why fret over it? The Lohars had nuked and poisoned the earth. Screw the old digs. The tigers had messed with humanity. I wanted them to gnash their teeth and pull out their fur over us. Maybe just as importantly, I wanted something to occupy their thoughts. Let them wonder what we would strike next. Let them focus on the terrorist attack instead of the Star Viking raid, at least for a few minutes, in order to let us execute our last maneuver. The mushroom cloud grew as a brilliant flare of noonday light expanded on the horizon. Hellburners have that effect. We only had the one, though. Heaviness squeezed my chest. Despite my hatred for the earth-destroying Lohars, I felt bad for the order to drop the nuke. Still, I didn't think my personal payback would happen today. That meant I had to concentrate on the here and now. Let's do it, I said. Go! All around me, DZ-9 shot upward into the sky like old-time Blue Angel jets. We attempted to rendezvous with the Achilles in the upper atmosphere. By the time we reached our limit, the light from the Hellburner had long since died down. I imagine every orbital and its sensors watched the sea. I also figured that many of them would be blind for a little while longer. When the explosion first blasted in the Horus Ocean, the Peru and the Achilles plunged down into the atmosphere. They came for different reasons. As the Achilles hovered in place with its anti-gravity pods whining at full power, Star Vikings drove to an open bay door. This was the tricky part. The cyclists didn't drive in. Instead, they hovered in place and pitched their cargo through the door. Then they leapt into the patrol boat. Afterward, the DZ-9 fell toward the ocean. Soon it was our turn. The larger Peru hovered beside the Achilles. We lifted between the spaceships as Dimitri maneuvered the cycle to the open door. Go, Commander, he told me. I stood and made sure not to look down. Instead, I focused on the open bay. With a leap and the cycle dipping under me, I shot through the gap into the waiting arms of fellow Star Vikings. A second later, Dimitri followed. His cycle plunged down. We lost three troopers who misjudged the distance or were wounded or too tired. I would have liked to rescue them. We had no more time, though. They dropped with the falling DZ-9s. The bay door closed and the Achilles headed for low orbit. Beside the patrol boat, the automated and quite empty Peru did likewise. Zoe's patrol boat had a special feature, a cloaking device. It didn't need to work long, but it needed to hide us from scanners for a few critical hours. I shed my symbiotic skin, depositing the quivering blob into its heated cylinder. After capping the unit, I literally ran down the ship's corridors reaching the bridge as the boat entered the darkness of space. Commander, Zoe said from her chair. 
She rose to move aside for me. No, sit down, I said. You're running the Achilles. I'm just here to watch. She nodded, sitting down and all business again as she rapped out commands. The two vessels rose together almost side by side. Now, Zoe said. A terrific hum vibrated the deck plates under my feet. The boat's pilot slowed our climb. On the main screen and in the viewport, I watched the Peru accelerate into higher orbit. Over our speakers, harsh Lohar voices uttered orders. We ignored them. So did the Peru. Did the orbital operators know about the looting of the Hall of Honor? It would appear so. No plasma cannons fired on the transport. If I had to guess, the Tigers didn't want to destroy the precious cargo they thought rode in the hauler. On auto, the Peru headed for deep space. I stared at the main screen. It showed a passive sensor image of what happened. Twenty Lohar military vessels peeled out of orbit, accelerating after the Peru. Clearly, they must have known about the sacrilege to the Hall of Honor. They must have known that whoever had attacked had stolen precious items. The Tigers obviously wanted those items back. In the Achilles, we tiptoed the rest of the way up from the planet. With the cloaking device, we slipped past orbitals and big Lohar battle cruisers. As a kid, I used to read war novels and history. World War II had always held a special place in my heart and imagination. I recalled the tale of German Lieutenant Commander Gunther Preen. On October 14, 1939, in U-47, a German submarine, Preen snuck into Scapa Flow at night. The British home fleet was concentrated there. Slipping past anti-submarine defenses, steel nets, for instance, and negotiating treacherous riptides, Preen fired two spreads of four torpedoes. He scored several hits against the battleship Royal Oak. In two minutes, the British capital ship went down, taking 786 officers and men with her. Afterward, Preen slipped out of the harbor and away, making the most gallant exploit of the sea war between the two nations. Standing on the Achilles Bridge behind Captain Zoe's chair, I felt a thrill similar to what Commander Preen must have felt back then. How long could our cloaking device hold? Maybe no longer than it took the Tigers to storm aboard the Peru. In the end, it took the Lohars 43 minutes for a battle cruiser to speed beside the transport. Power-armored Tigers made the small voyage between the two ships, landing on the Peru's hull. We'd been waiting for that. The transport exploded into a massive fireball. The battle cruiser's shield held for a tenth of a second. After that, it went down and the Peru's debris smashed through the armored hull, destroying the Lohar capital ship. There wouldn't be anything left of the borders. It was a dirty tactic, I know. I planned it that way. I wanted the horror of the situation to dull their reactions. Later rage would consume the Tigers. For now, I wanted them drugged with dazed disbelief at the loss of the precious cargo the Peru supposedly carried. For the next several hours, we headed cloaked for the distant jump gate. By that time, radio traffic raged with accusations back and forth. Priests called for an hour of silent grief. Lohar scientists begged for decontamination units. A psychic force seemed to build over Zalambra. I could sense it aboard the Achilles. It felt as if the unified fury and tiger grief reached out to our patrol boat. No one cheered here. No one clapped each other on the back. I made the rounds through the corridors and cabins. Relieved assault troopers stared at me with huge eyes. Are we going to make it, Commander? A man asked. We're doing it, I said. But we're far from out of it yet. I wanted to tell them to wear slippers and keep their voices down. It wouldn't make any difference, but in our hearts we must have all felt that. Finally, I returned to the bridge. Zoe turned to me. She shook her head. The woman looked exhausted. Please, Commander, take over. I nodded. She got up, moving like an old woman. With a sigh, I sank into the command chair. I could feel the weight of responsibility descend upon me. Maybe this was why I loved riding the cycles so much. 
I'd felt free hours ago on the planet. This, it strained my nerves and curdled my gut. The enemy sensor sweeps are getting stronger, sir, the comm operator told me. A hatch opened. I turned my chair. Ella walked to me and leaned against an armrest. Maybe we should just make a dash for it, she said. Look at those battle cruisers heading for the jump gate, I said. Their beams would spear us in a moment. They're going to know we went through the gate. We'll see, I said. Time ticked by with agonizing slowness. Was this how Preen had felt on the way out of Scapa Flow? The Germans had sunk a mighty British battleship. Their lives would have been mud if they failed to slip away undetected. Ours would be scrambled atoms in the void of a Lohar star system if we failed. How could we beat the Lohars? What would Gunther Preen do in this situation? For the next ten minutes I thought furiously, and I drew a blank. We weren't U-47. We were the Star Vikings. Yeah. What would a Viking captain of old have done in this situation? Our cloaked patrol boat would never make it past the starfighters beginning to spread out in front of the jump gate. Two battle cruisers already waited there. Three more came, with even more heading out. Did they know we'd made it off the planet? Maybe they suspected a trick. How would a star viking react? My eyes widened. I turned to Ella. What's wrong? she asked. I know how we can escape the Horus star system, I said. Tell me, she said. I did. After listening to the idea, she told me I was a lunatic. Maybe she was right. We had thirty minutes to get ready. Then it would be time to attempt the craziest attack of the mission. I pulled my blob of symbiotic armor out of the heat unit. Stepping onto it, I let the warm substance slide up my legs. Soon I put on a helmet and shouldered a thruster pack onto my shoulders. Around me, assault troopers did likewise. With Zoe's people added in, I had 173 effectives. That left the bridge crew to run the Achilles. The three battle cruisers from Horus had already begun breaking maneuvers. The two in front waited with the wall of starfighters behind them at the jump gate. I had another Bankuv, a souped-up weapon we called Hot Shot. It would burn out after ten or eleven intense laser blasts. Usually a laser rifle would fire for a long time. Each of these laser bolts had the ability to burn through Lohar-powered armor. Soon, if everything went right, we would be facing power-armored legionaries again. All right, people, I said over the short speaker. Probably only half of us are going to be alive an hour from now. This is balls out to the firewall. I don't see any other way of getting home, though. Kill every Lohar you see, no exceptions. Don't give the engine crew time to blow their ship. This is a blitzkrieg attack plus ten thousand. Any questions? No one had any. We waited in the cargo bay, the one we'd entered not so long ago above the Horus Ocean. Hang on, Zoe said over the ship speaker. I grabbed a crash bar. Others did likewise. A period of hard maneuvers took place. One more minute, Zoe said. My palms became slick with sweat. Would the patrol boat remain cloaked long enough? Thirty seconds, she said. I would have liked to say something more to my troopers. My mouth had turned too dry. Now, Zoe said. The bay door began to slide open. Stars appeared. Then I saw the underbelly of a big Lohar battle cruiser. It, too, had an open bay door. Fighters launched down from it. That was our one stroke of luck. It might be all we needed. Hang on just a moment longer, Zoe said. I'm taking us closer. She maneuvered the patrol boat. A Lohar fighter barely missed us as it flashed past. The wash must have hit our cloaking field in some manner. An electrical discharge flared between the two vessels. Ours was a toy compared to the battle cruiser. Someone spotted us, Zoe said. Go! I let go of the crash bar. With my magnetic boots, I ran along the deck plates. When I reached the open bay door, I cut their power and jumped. At the same moment, I turned on the thruster pack. At maximum acceleration, I rushed the battlecruiser's fighter launch bay. 
Behind me, other Star Vikings did likewise. It was a race, all right. We were going to board and storm the vessel and try to take it over as our own. I expelled hydrogen spray, a white misty trail behind me as I strained to reach the open bay door. If I failed, humanity would never make a comeback. My teeth ground together as rage consumed me. I envisioned the Emperor himself aboard the craft. My head began to beat in time to my heart. A hazy red nimbus surrounded my vision. A cool, detached part of my mind, a little citadel buried deeply in my brain, watched as Berserker Gang overcame me. Maybe the suit pumped the drugs. Maybe I did it on my own. For once, I couldn't tell the difference. Raving, I closed the distance and the bay doors began sliding shut. I came like a cannonball, readying my bonkoof. Ten shots to win a species, mine, another extended bout at life. I flashed past a giant door and pulled the trigger. Eighty meters away, a clear surface shattered so shards glittered in the hangar bay. A Lohar officer backed away from his controls. I shot again and he exploded in fur, blood, and bone. Speeding fast, I twisted my torso, readied myself, and struck a bulkhead. Cannonballing off it, pushing with my legs to guide my direction, I shot at the wrecked control chamber. I swiveled my torso once more and blasted a roar of hydrogen spray from the thrusters. I had to slow down. More armored Star Vikings flew into the hangar bay. Their laser bolts took down floating tigers and others running away with magnetic boots clanking along the deck plates. Swiveling around again, I pulled the trigger three times. The shots blasted within the chamber. The closing bay doors halted, frozen with ten meters of space between them. Then I hit a gory wall within the control chamber, bounced and floated out. A big hatch deeper in the hangar bay opened and power-armored Lohars poked their rifles through. I emptied my bonkoof at them, dropping three Tiger Legionaries. Before they murdered me, I landed behind steel cylinders, activating my boots. My head still beat with a savage pulse. Instead of sonic grenades, I had proton hand bombs. Pressing a thumb on the igniter, I hurled one so it sped like a bullet. Two Tigers shot at me. One missed. The other hit symbiotic skin, making my suit quiver with pain. The Berserker gang evaporated from my brain, making me realize the suit had been giving me the madness. At the big hatch leading into the interior of the battle cruiser, a proton explosion took out the legionaries. Follow me, I radioed. In leaping bounds, I moved to the wrecked portal into the ship. Grabbing a Lohar rifle, slipping on a power pack, I charged down the corridor. It had gravity, so I moved like a freight train on meth. Star Vikings rushed behind me. We had surprise and murdered every tiger we saw. More power-armored legionaries appeared. We killed them, losing ten troopers to their weapons. Dimitri split off, leading a team for the bridge. Rollo likewise went another way as he fought to reach the T-missiles. I battled my way to the engine room. Instead of playing a skilled game of maneuver and counter-move, I lobbed proton bombs and rushed to close quarters. There I stabbed with my force blade. If I'd tried for perfect tactics, I'm afraid we would have traded shots from around corners. That would have slowed everything down. Time counted more than ensuring we didn't take casualties. It meant the headlong attack cost human lives. We traded them for time. Then the Lohars must have run out of power-armored legionaries. At least the ones facing all died. Our last gamble turned into tiger butchery. Twenty-two Star Vikings, along with me, burst into a huge chamber. It contained silver-colored, throbbing fusion cells. I shot sprinting Lohar engineers trying to get away. Then I blew away the heads of three tigers madly tapping at controls. I assumed they attempted to build a fusion overload. Star Vikings rushed to those panels. Three minutes later, my techs turned to me and popped up their thumbs. They had the engines under control. In my helmet, I flipped onto a different channel. Dimitri? I asked. We have control of the bridge, Commander. 
but I have bad news. The other battle cruisers are turning to engage us. Are the ship shields at full power? I asked. Yes, Commander, Dimitri said. Is the Achilles in the main hold? Yes, Commander, the Cossack said. Then hang on, I'm coming up to you. We cannot defeat the enemy fighters and the battle cruisers about to engage us, he said. You don't think so? I asked. No, Commander, Dimitri said. Once more, I switched onto a different channel. Rollo, are you ready? Give me ten more minutes, Creed, Rollo said. You have five, then it's go time. That's cutting it too close, Rollo said. It's not going to work if you don't prepare properly. Five minutes isn't enough time to rig everything perfectly. Through the comm line, I brayed with laughter. No battle is perfect, my friend. It's all about winning. Nothing else matters. You think we can win through to the jump gate and beyond? Rollo asked, sounding dubious. We're about to find out, I said. Now quit jabbering and get those T-missiles ready for launch. Chapter 27 I stood on the bridge of our captured battle cruiser. It was a big ship, an engine of destruction, although unequal against a Jelk battle jumper. This vessel must have been a fifth the size of Shaw Cloth's former flagship, which gives some indication of a battle jumper's power. Ten Star Vikings stood on the bridge with me, Dimitri among them. The rest of the boarders had returned to the Achilles. The patrol boat waited in another cargo bay, the armored doors sealed shut. I still breathed hard from the tremendous exertion. Commander, Dimitri said. The enemy wants to bargain with you. Put him on the side screen, I said. Her, Commander. The Lohar Admiral is a female. Whatever, I said. My helmet sat on the former battle cruiser captain's chair. He lay sprawled on the deck plates, half his head a gory ruin. A tiger appeared on the screen. She must have sprinkled ash over her fur because it was dull gray color. Her red eyes squinted at me. I used a technique on her that Shaw Cloth had played on us during our attack on the portal planet. With Dimitri at the comm controls, I had him transmit a fuzzy image of me and deepen my voice. During the portal planet attack, the Jelk had pretended to be a badden. It had scared the crap out of us at the time. Maybe I could pull something like that here. I am Admiral Listmarker the tiger woman said. Who are you? Abaddon, I said. The Lohar recoiled, her eyes widening. You lie, she whispered. I forced a laugh. Why do you think I struck the purple to make a hall of honor? I have no idea. It was barbaric and sacrilegious. First, I will stamp out your honor, I said trying to sound like the devil himself. Then I will demand your lives in payment for your crimes. What crimes? the admiral shouted. That of living in the same space-time continuum as me and my cargs, I said. She became visibly emotional, breathing hard as she wrestled with her superstitious fears. Finally she pointed a clawed finger at me. Whoever you are, I demand you return our sacred articles of honor. If you do, we will let you depart with your life. If not, you will die. You are wrong, I said. It is you who are about to die. You have one crippled battle cruiser. We have a flotilla of starfighters and four battle cruisers with fifteen more on the way. Prepare to die, I said, and I nodded to Dimitri. The Cossack cut the connection. Did she buy it? he asked. I had no time to answer him. Instead, I told our pilot, full speed for the jump gate. Then I radioed Rollo in the T-missile quarters. Send the first one, I said. I'm as likely to ignite it in here, he said over the helmet radio. Then get it out there. Then do it right, I said. Like I have a choice in the matter, Rollo said. You'll get what I can get. I would have preferred more confidence from him. This was stressful enough. 
I stared at the screen, watching, waiting. Starfighters raced at us, about two hundred space vessels readying their particle beam cannons. A battle cruiser stood in our way, heating its considerable number of heavy weapons. The other battle cruisers came up fast from behind. They're waiting for our move, Dimitri said. They don't want to destroy us because they still think they can get their precious items back. I blinked hard. Why was waiting such a difficult thing to do? My plan was simple. A T-missile was a teleporting missile. It was an ingenious weapon. Special tubes launched them. I didn't have time for that. Nor did I have time to make precise calculations for each missile. N-7 would have been needed. He was on the patrol boat. Instead, Rollo would cause one missile at a time to teleport outside our battle cruiser. From within my helmet on the headphones, I heard Rollo shout, Fire one! Inside our battle cruiser, nothing extra happened. Outside, it was a different story. A T-missile appeared behind the approaching starfighters. That meant the missile was close to us, too. Its thermonuclear warhead ignited creating a blinding white flash. Fire two! Rollo shouted. As the small attack fighters vaporized in the atomic blast, a second T-missile appeared. This one ignited between two approaching battle cruisers and us. From this close, our ship took the blast and hard radiation. Our screens buckled. Keep them popping, I shouted at Rollo. Saturate the battlefield with nuclear fire. Roger that, Creed, Rollo said in a hoarse voice. This was like lobbing grenades a few yards from oneself and hoping the body armor held. It decimated the starfighters and hammered the enemy battle cruisers. Unfortunately, we started taking a pounding from our own weapons as we headed for the jump gate. In slow motion, like a dying destruction derby car near the end of its existence, our battle cruiser glided past the wreckage of hundreds of starfighters. The nearest Lohar battle cruiser slammed point defense shells into our ruptured hull. The force screen had died several minutes ago. From behind us, enemy particle beams shredded our ship. Then another T missile popped into existence beside a Lohar battle cruiser. Because of the thermonuclear blast, I lost sight of the enemy. The particle beams stopped, though. Seconds later, our bridge shuddered. More of the ceiling crashed down onto the deck plates. Electrical wiring writhed like angry snakes, hissing and showering sparks. Lights flashed and klaxons wailed. Get to the patrol boat, I ordered. You'll need help up here, sir. No, I'm coming with you. Just give me a few more seconds. Creed, Dimitri shouted. You cannot stay. Go, I said. Hurry. Dimitri stubbornly shook his helmeted head. Look. Another thermonuclear explosion shook our vessel. Everything went dark except for a side viewing screen. I only have two T-missiles left, Rollo radioed me through harsh static. Save them for the other side, I said. Don't you think I know that? He bellowed. Dimitri and I watched the screen. Our battered vessel slid past the last starfighter. The enemy battle cruiser no longer peppered us with its point defense cannons. Behind us, by several thousand kilometers, another battle cruiser slid into view. Its particle beam struck our battered vessel. Sloughing off like ice from an iceberg, more of our craft fell away. Internal explosions made it hard to stay standing on the buckling deck. At that point, our battle cruiser reached the jump gate, sliding through toward the other side. Groaning, I pushed myself off the deck plates where I'd fallen. This jump had been particularly bad. I floated up toward the ruined ceiling. The anti-gravity plates had stopped working. The flu-like symptoms of jump left me achy and dull-witted. Dimitri, I asked in a hoarse voice. There has to be a better way for star traveling, the Cossack said, his voice weak. Tell me about it. How are the rest of you feeling? We're ready, Commander, one of the other troopers said. Rollo, I radioed. 
He coughed before saying, I'm all set. Pushing against the ceiling, I floated down to the only working screen. It showed the jump gate behind our vessel. So far, no one else had followed us through. Now, I told Rollo. Seconds passed and turned into a full minute. I hated this damn waiting. What was wrong? Why couldn't Rollo? Just then, a T-missile appeared by the jump gate. Its fusion engine burned. These missiles could move in the normal manner as well. A blue tail appeared behind the exhaust port. It grew longer by the second, accelerating the missile. Our gift to the Lohars went through the jump gate back to the Horus star system. Would the timer function? Would the warhead explode, smashing nearing enemy craft at just the right time? Go, I told Dimitri and the others. We have to get back to the patrol boat. Before they could argue with me, I leapt for the corridor. The hatch onto the bridge had blown open some time ago. With my HUD giving me visibility of the dark hull, I propelled myself off the sides. I swam faster and faster, taking the corners at a dangerous speed. Behind me, the others did likewise. We were old hands at these kinds of zero-G maneuvers. In less than five minutes, we vomited out of the last hatch, shooting for the patrol boat sitting in the big bay. From a different hatch, Rollo flew for the boat, meeting us at the Achilles. We scrambled inside. My last glimpse of the inner battle cruiser was the bay doors lurching open. Thank God they still worked after the pounding this vessel had taken. Before I reached the bridge, Zoe Artemis guided the Achilles out of the battle cruiser's belly. She built up speed, moving away from it. I entered the bridge, still wearing my symbiotic skin. Turn on the cloak, Zoe said. A member of her crew did just that tapping her board. That caused a high-pitched whining sound throughout the patrol boat. Captain Artemis, a man said, pointing at me. Zoe swiveled around and grinned hugely. I wanted to hug and kiss her. Commander, you made it, she said. Captain, the sensor operator said. Lohar fighters have just come through the jump gate. Put it on the main screen, Zoe said. I steadied myself holding on to the back of her chair. I don't know if the cloak will hold, she whispered to me. The starfighter earlier damaged our field generator. I didn't say a word. I watched the screen, wanting to know what the Lohars were going to do. As I did, a big battle cruiser appeared in our star system. That was bad. The Admiral is hailing our old battle cruiser, the comm operator said. Let her do it as much as she wants, Zoe said. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the screen. Would the Tigers fire at the empty vessel? I didn't think they would. They didn't dare. Several minutes passed. My gut tightened all the time. Another Lohar warship entered the system. Shuttles left the first Tiger battle cruiser. Those looked undamaged. Six of the assault shuttles gathered under the wrecked and empty battle cruiser. Once ready, they moved in a flock toward the battered hulk. One by one, the shuttles entered the ship. At that point, Rollo's last T-missile ignited inside the vessel. Even on the screen, I could see it shudder. A microsecond later, it expanded like a slow-motion grenade. The sides blew off and a white explosion grew. Coils, fusion engines, hull parts, dead tigers and humans, water, concentrates, mass of junk blew apart in an expanding ball of destruction. Let's hope that blinds their sensors for a time, I said. Our bridge crew turned to stare at me. I guess my words sounded inappropriate. I couldn't help it. Anyway, long story short, we made it by playing the same trick twice against the Lohars. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? As the surviving Lohars began to search the debris, we tiptoed away in the cloaked Achilles. The good news was that this system had several jump gates to choose from. We slid toward the nearest. If we could get some real separation from the Lohars, we wouldn't have to worry about our damaged cloaking device lasting any longer. Captain, the comm operator said, the Lohar Admiral is placing a system-wide message. Should I put it up? Zoe turned to me. 
I nodded. In a moment, the tiger with the ash fur appeared. She seemed tired beyond anything I'd seen. You are not a badden, she said. I know that for a fact. Never fear, we will learn who you are. We will find you. Then we will destroy your race limb from limb. I don't know how you did this or why, but you will never gain from your vile deed. The cloaking whine increased within the patrol boat. Zoe looked worried. Our invisibility isn't going to hold much longer, she whispered to me. Race for the nearest jump gate, I told her. They might see us if we accelerate too fast. If we want to win, we're going to have to risk it. Reluctantly, Zoe gave the order. The Achilles built up velocity. That made the cloaking device labor overtime. It sounded worse than before. On the bridge, we watched the main screen and listened to the sensor operator give a minute-by-minute -minute report. I think you're right, Zoe told me. The last T-missile hurt the enemy's sensing systems. Afraid of jinxing our good luck, I didn't say anything else about that. Ten minutes later, Zoe asked, Why aren't they splitting up to search the different jump gates? Good question, I said. Despite the Admiral's words, maybe they wonder if we really are a badden. The possibility terrifies them, making them afraid to go off alone. I grinned. It doesn't seem they know if we're even alive or not. Zoe frowned. I don't think she accepted my explanations. The truth was, I didn't know why the Tiger Admiral didn't raise ships to each jump gate. By the time they decided to do anything else, it was too late. We entered the next gate, and it looked like we had raided Horus and gotten away with the loot. Now we had to see if we could reach home in time to stop the Emperor's armada. Chapter 28 the come-down after the daring assault brought depression to the survivors. Instead of cheering wildly at what we'd done, we remembered the friends who died at Horus and during the deadly battle getting out of the star system. The small size of the patrol boat didn't help matters. To make sure no one went stir-crazy, I began training exercises three days after leaving Horus. Board troopers were harder to handle than exhausted, recovering soldiers. As the trip lengthened, I increased the intensity of the drills. Even so, we had our problems the next few weeks. They had to do with the ship itself. Despite our best efforts to keep the Achilles out of the fighting, the patrol boat had taken damage. Most of it had come from our own T-missiles. The cloaking device shorted out for good. We weren't going to be able to use it again until the ship went through a month of repairs at a dockyard. Worse for us, the anti-gravity plates had taken a pounding. Much of our trip, they didn't work. Extended time in zero-G wasn't any fun. There was another problem with that. Without the anti-gravity dampeners, hard acceleration strained the crew. I ordered Zoe to push the ship anyway. We had to keep ahead of the news. I could imagine the shock waves hitting the Lohar worlds, particularly those belonging to Purple Tamika. A league-wide manhunt must have already started against us. Certainly the Lohars on Horus were going to find human corpses. How long would it take the Tigers to reach the right conclusion? Our engineers worked overtime on the ship to keep it running. There were fights among the crew. The people using their fists I could understand. Then two troopers fought over a man. One of the women killed the other with a force blade. I debated executing the victor. I couldn't afford to lose any more fighters, though. So I put her in a closet, calling it a brig. Afterward, for five miserable days, I ran everyone but the bridge crew and Tex through savage calisthenics. Maybe I took the guilt gnawing at my conscience out on them. Rollo warned me. If you don't ease up, you're going to have a mutiny on your hands. I ignored him. A day later, Dimitri told me the same thing. I knew why I couldn't hear them. I kept thinking about the Hellburner. That I really needed to explode it? I wondered if I'd destroyed half the planet. First Sonicot, and now Horus. How many Lohar worlds should I pulverize? My bloodlust against the Tigers must have been waning.
and I found that hard to deal with. What saved me from mutiny, I believe, was running into an orange Tomica warship in the Sargol star system. The place swarmed with asteroids and heavy metal meteors. It was supposedly neutral territory and a miner's playground. We have to fix our anti-gravity systems, Ella told me. We floated in a corridor while hanging on to side rails. Too many troopers are on the edge, Creed. If you continue to push everyone... Okay, already, I said. Their combined nagging had put me on edge. After some tough haggling, we put the patrol boat into an asteroid dockyard called Rill 7. Squat-bodied Ilk ran the place. I paid them in platinum. They sent two tech teams aboard, dragging their equipment on sleds. Dimitri watched the one, Rollo the other. I kept N7 with me and toured the interior asteroid. The Ilk were busy hollowing it out, using the heavy metal ores for their trade. We went to the main bazaar. The Ilk held it in a vast underground hall several kilometers in circumference. All kinds of league races bartered and dickered with each other from metal-walled booths. A few of the booths were the size of old Safeway stores with floating forklifts to bring down the items. Fortunately for us, we'd traveled fast enough from Horus that no one had heard about our raid yet. As we explored the marketplace, N7 pointed out five Lohars in body armor. The Tigers argued with a squat ilk over combat weaponry. What's a mica do you think they are? I shouted at N7. The bazaar thrummed with noise, making talking a chore. The androids stood for a time, watching the Tigers. Finally, one of them must have felt the scrutiny. He turned and scowled at N7. I believe they are orange, N7 informed me. Let's find out. I said. N7 put a restraining hand on my forearm. If I'm wrong, it could mean trouble. It could mean it anyway, I said. As I brushed past aliens, I slapped away the slippery tentacle of a thief trying to pickpocket me. No matter how far one went from Earth, nothing ever really changed in a fundamental fashion. The biggest Lohar watched our advance. He was a good seven and a half feet tall, a towering individual. Even better, he had the widest and deepest chest I'd ever seen on a Lohar. Was he a wrestler or a combat specialist? Who are you? The Lohar growled at me, with his ears laid flat against his skull. I knew that was a bad sign. We are friends of Orange Tamika, I said in the tiger tongue. The Lohar's head swayed back. The others talking to the Ilk pulled away, coming closer to us, with their hands drifting to the guns and knives on their belts. Are you bounty hunters? The big Lohar growled. The way the other tigers readied themselves made me wonder if the big guy had reason to fear hunters. I decided to take a chance. I personally know Dr. Sant, I said. The big tiger hissed and stepped back among his friends. You're being rash, N7 whispered to me. I was too busy watching the Lohars to worry about that. The big boy nodded, it seemed to himself, as if he'd made a decision. He muttered at the others. Then he stepped toward me. Once Sant was a doctor. I know, I said. Eight years ago, I journeyed with him to the portal planet in hyperspace. Prince Venturi led the mission. Who are you? The tiger asked in a hoarse voice. Are you of Orange Tamika? I asked. He watched me with his cat eyes. What was he thinking? Finally, he pushed aside the bottom of his torso armor, revealing an orange shirt underneath. I'm Commander Creed. I said. N7 shook his head as if he could take back my words. Once again, the tiger hissed. You lie. Creed is in the solar system. I have heard the seer say so many times. Do you mean Seer Sant? I asked. You just called him Doctor. Now you name him correctly. 
What treachery do you plan, human? Me? I said, jamming a thumb against my chest. Look, buddy, the Shi Feng tried to assassinate me on Earth. They failed. As one, the Lohars roared and went into combat stances, two of them drawing hook knives. The noises of the bazaar lessened. Many aliens turned to stare at the Lohars and then at us. The big tiger looked around. He noticed others watching us. Even so, he said so only I could hear. I must slay you, Outlander. You have spoken words that should have remained silent. Wrong, I told him. I just proved to you that I'm Commander Creed. If you've heard Sant talk about me, you know that I do and say whatever I want. This is true, one of the other Lohar said. Maybe he is who he claims to be, Baron. Baron, I asked. Slowly the big tiger straightened. His friends put away their knives. The regular loud sounds of the bazaar quickly resumed. The other aliens must have realized there wasn't going to be a fight. I am Baron Visconti, the tiger said in a deep voice. Prince Venturi was my third cousin on my father's side. Venturi never had your size, I said. No, Visconti said. The prince took after his mother's people. Not his father's. Sure, I said. Come this way, Visconti said. It is not proper for us to speak of these things in the open where any ear can hear. I glanced at N7. He shook his head. Good. I wanted him paranoid so he'd stay alert. Then I indicated for Visconti to lead the way. The Baron guided us to a tent on an open, grassy area to the side of the bazaar. Bright sun lamps provided the greenery with light. They also made it hot. Other Lohars stood guard around the tent. Two outposts held heavy machine gun teams with barrels poking past piled sandbags. Come inside, Visconti said. Inside the tent, a tiger opened a flap into an interior sanctum. N7 and I headed toward it. No, Visconti said, putting a big paw on N7's chest. The machine cannot enter. N7 and I traded glances. Forget it, then, I told the tiger. Baron Visconti looked down at me. It would not be seemly if he came within. Hey, I said, we can talk just as easily out here. The big guy thought about that. He nodded, and the trace of a grin might have appeared on his face. Now I truly know that you are Commander Creed. It has been said you drive Lohars mad by your arrogance. Experiencing your vanity for myself, I begin to understand how hard it is to work with you. The stories are true, after all. Yeah, I'm a real head case. Yet it is said you are a mighty warrior. Not just mighty, I said. The greatest. He eyed me. I think he wanted to test my mettle, see if he was tougher than me. Finally he laughed. Bring your machine. For the great Commander Creed I will make an exception. We went into the sanctum, sat on mats, and sipped a hot lohar drink called Task. Look, I told him after lowering my drinking bowl. I'm sure you're in love with your customs, but we don't have time to indulge in all of them. Visconti brushed his paws together and waved off a server. The Baron leaned his head toward me and spoke in a whisper. It will be as you say. He seemed to compose himself before adding, I wonder at your presence, Commander Creed. At first I believed you an assassin from Purple to Micah. I recognized you as human, but... He shrugged. Why do you wonder? I asked. He laughed before saying, I am bringing my house troops to the fleet. I have decided to cast my lot with Seer Sant. He heads to the solar system there to stop the Emperor from destroying your people. 
Sans headed for Earth? I have just said so, Visconti said with a bite to his voice. I am unaccustomed to having my words questioned. Yeah, I said. Sorry about that. Do you know how close the Emperor's Armada is to Earth? Several weeks away, maybe as much as a month, Visconti said. I made some quick calculations. If we continued the journey at a little more than top speed, we might just make it home in time to face the Emperor. How far is Dr. Sand from Earth? I asked. She is called Seer Sant, Visconti said. Of course, I said. That's what I meant to say. The Baron stared at the ceiling in seeming annoyance. Finally, he said, The forward elements of the Orange to Mica fleet should already be approaching your world. We will attempt to ambush the Emperor's leading elements before they reach your star system. That had been my original plan. Was that a coincidence? I decided to find out. Too bad the Starkians didn't agree to join us, I said. The contractors, the Baron asked with distaste. I do not understand your meaning. I gave him a quick rundown on my offer to Baba Gobo. Visconti sat back, stroking his furry chin. That was an interesting offer, if lacking honor. Surviving a crusade has an honor all its own, I said. The Baron chuckled as he shook his head. Your way of thinking is difficult for me, but I can understand your point, Commander. You must know, though, that Starkians have hired themselves to the Jelk before. That placed them beyond the pale of righteousness. I used to fight for the Jelk Corporation, I said. But here I am on the side of the angels. Beside me, N7 stiffened, closing his eyes as if in pain. Visconti studied me, once more stroking his chin. Do you have a point in saying that? I do, I said, thinking on the fly. Lohar's destroyed my world and nearly wiped out my people. I've been told that was to save me from Jelk slavery. That was only partly the reason, Visconti said. What was the other part? The Emperor fears your race. I'd never heard that before. It put a new complexity on the situation. Why would that be? I asked. Visconti shook his head. I do not know. Perhaps the Emperor heard an oracle about you. If he did, he should have shared the knowledge with the other Tamikas. He has flown alone in regard to the human problem. Now we're a problem? Visconti spread his paws. The Lohars are about to wage a bloody civil war. Two opposing armadas race for Earth heading toward a collision. Yes, you are a problem. Can Orange Tamika win the battle? I asked. Visconti looked away. I cannot see how, he said. Orange, Yellow, and Green have joined forces. Several outlawed Tamikas have added their paltry number of vessels to the rebel fleet. The Emperor must have two to three times our fighting craft. This was highly interesting news. Why are the fleets headed to Earth, exactly? I asked. Because of the Forerunner object, he said. Surely you realize it is the most venerated in the League, perhaps in the Orion Arm. This was news. Why hadn't Sant told me? Frowning, I realized the Emperor had let that slip when we'd talked in the Sanakat system. Felix Rex Logos had once served the Lohar Fifth Legion as its commander. Where would a prince-to-be emperor serve? In the most illustrious post, of course. Our artifact near Ceres was critical, drawing the Lohars to us. It would appear that a victory in the solar system had even greater importance for the Tigers than I'd realized. You need the Starkian ships to help you even the odds, I said. There is merit to your words, but you already offered them a chance to regain honor. Just like a Starkian, Baba Gobo refused. 
That's one way to look at it, I said. Still, if they had all their vessels in one place, maybe it would give them and you a fighting chance. I expect Baba Gobo thought this was a lost cause. It's not, if you rebels have enough warships. With a huge hand, Visconti picked up his tiny porcelain cup. The two looked incongruous together. He sipped and lowered the cup to his lap, sitting thoughtfully for a long time. Twice he gave me sharp glances. The Baron was clearly working something out in his mind. I decided silence was my friend, as I wanted that something to mature. You are too hopeful, Visconti said at last. That means you know something more. I believe you have a secret. It's true, I do, I admitted. Can you tell me your secret? Sorry, I would be unwise to let you know. Visconti scowled. Are you suggesting your secret would bring harm to the Lohars? Arm to purple to mica, I said. My secret would most certainly strengthen orange to mica. Then you must tell me. I'm afraid not, I said. What if I told you I will not allow you to leave this tent unless you tell me? I wanted to tell him that I'll have to kill you. This time, however, I decided on tact. Where would be the honor in that? I asked. We're drinking task together in friendship. Would you bring dishonor to your house? Not willingly, he admitted. Then I am safe talking to you. Yes, he said, nodding. You are safe. For the moment. Sant should seek out the Starkians, I said. He should ask for their aid. No, Visconti said gravely. In the past, Starkians hired out to the Jelk Corporation. Starkians lack honor. They are untrustworthy as allies. That was my point a few minutes ago. I once worked for the Jelk Corporation and rebelled. Why did I work for them originally? in order to save my people from extinction. The Starkians are a dwindling race. Now they seek to save their race. They are unworthy of saving, Visconti said flatly. To you, maybe, but not to them. They seek survival. Use that for Orange Tomica's good. What will a few more warships matter anyway? Visconti asked with a shrug. Perhaps they're the edge Orange Tomica needs for victory. Or would you prefer to let your bigotry doom your house to death? Will you let Purple Tomica destroy you and your kind? You killed Princess Nee on an Orange Tomica dreadnought, Visconti said. The Emperor wants revenge against you. Maybe I could buy my Tomica's survival by handing you over to him. Maybe, I said locking stairs with the tiger. After a second, Visconti shook his head. I will not dishonor my house in such a manner. You went to the portal planet and won existence for our universe. I owe you a debt of gratitude. In doing as you did, you heaped praise and glory onto Orange to Mica. The Orange should rule the Lohars, I said. Yes. To do so, you must defeat the Emperor's armada. Visconti raised his cup, sipping once more. He inhaled, expanding his chest. I have decided, he said. You must return to Earth as quickly as possible. If you wish to contact the Starkians, that is your task, not mine or any other Lohars. To help you in your secret quest, I will give you my fastest warship. In exchange, I will accept your patrol boat. My boat is already fast, I said. Visconti shook his head. Not nearly as fast as the quarrel. It is our latest advancement, able to reach twice the velocity as your craft. Besides, your boat is in a dockyard. I know the ilk. They will delay repairs and force you to pay more until they have drained you of exchange units. You would be wise to accept my offer, Commander. 
Did he know what the Achilles held? Did he suspect? Baron Visconti was one big tiger. He also seemed sharp. Did I dare trust him? How did he know so much about our patrol boat? It would be a risk unloading and then reloading the relics from Purple to Micah's Hall of Honor. Yet I didn't see the utility of getting back to Earth a week after humanity had perished. Yes, I said. I accept your offer. Chapter 29 The exchange went flawlessly. A day later, we left the Sargol star system, accelerating toward the jump gate. Three days into the journey, a tap came at the closed hatch to my quarters. It was a Spartan chamber with a cot, desk, and view screen. Slapping a switch, I saw N7 standing at the portal. He looked uneasy. May I speak with you, Commander? he asked. Come in, I said. I sat on the cot. N7 leaned against the desk. The android refused my offer of a drink. Why are you looking so confused? I asked. You sense it. Would I ask you if I didn't? Ah, an interesting point, N7 said. He stiffened against the desk, becoming formal. Commander, I have been uneasy for several days. At first I could not fathom the reason. Finally, I ran a probability analysis. An analysis regarding what? I asked. That is an astute question. At first, I made it a broad analysis as I attempted to pinpoint my unease. I could not accept that I had intuition or an instinct, as you humans perceive. Those are illogical concepts filled with emotion. I still struggle with those. I waited, saying nothing. I'd seldom seen N7 so agitated. After six hours of inquiry, my analysis finally reached a conclusion. Our meeting with Baron Visconti was too coincidental for it to have occurred at random. Why do you say that? I asked. Several times before the meeting, you spoke of the need to reach Earth faster than our craft could achieve. What did Baron Visconti offer us? Just what we needed. A faster ship. You have a point to this, I said. After the meeting, you said it was odd that the Baron knew so much about the Achilles. I pondered your statement and ran another analysis. It seems clear that the Baron was privy to the facts before our encounter. Are you saying the Baron played us? N7 cocked his head as if puzzled. Ah, I see. You are asking if he maneuvered us into doing what he wished us to do. Yes, only I said it in a pithier way. Please, Commander, let me continue with my analysis report. Sure, I said. Probability factors led me to the conclusion that Baron Visconti wanted to meet with you in order to give you his speedster. Why would this be? Because he or his superiors wanted you on Earth sooner rather than later. I said nothing. I believe the Baron wishes you to contact the Starkians, N7 said. Yet even after reaching this conclusion, I was troubled. I allowed the analysis to probe deeper. Three hours later, I reached a new and startling conclusion. Yeah? Dr. Sant watched our proceedings with Visconti, N7 said. What? I asked. You can't possibly know that. I can and do, N7 said. During the meeting, I detected a hint of a familiar odor. Only after these labored analyses did I allow my brain core to match the scents. It was that of Dr. Sant. I also saw the claw patch the doctor usually wears on his left sleeve. It is conceivable the doctor removed it and forgot to take it before we entered the inner tent. So you're saying Sant was hiding on Rill 7 and through Baron Visconti he maneuvered us into heading back to Earth faster? Exactly, N7 said. Why? In order to aid Orange to Micah in the coming battle with the Emperor, the android said. That seems like a mighty big stretch, I said. No, Dr. Sant has attempted a risky political tactic 
rebellion against the governing authority. He has allies, as Baron Visconti related. I believe Dr. Sant wants you to convince Baba Gobo to join the rebellion so Orange Tamika has a greater chance for success. That's not how I meant a big stretch, I said. How could Sant possibly know the Achilles would come to Rill 7? I asked myself a similar question, and Seven said. The answer lies with the Forerunner artifacts. During our stay with Prince Venturi aboard the Dreadnought, we learned the Lohars have an oracle. I remember, I said. Can Forerunner artifacts foretell the future? And Seven asked. I do not believe so. Yet we have learned that Forerunner objects can communicate with each other. Perhaps as interesting, they are able to scan remarkable distances. Could the artifacts inform each other on particular occurrences? With enough information and computational ability, the artifacts could make astute guesses on future events. That information might fool lesser beings. The Lohar would take the data as an oracle. I frowned as I followed his logic. So you're telling me a forerunner object told Sant about us? It is a possibility, N7 said. That would mean the artifacts are interested in what happens among us. That, too, is possible. I'm not sure I like that, I said. It does add a new layer of complexity to our situation, N7 said. Why would Holgatha have gone to the portal planet eight years ago? Did the artifact have a greater ulterior motive than it has already admitted to us? I give that a high probability, N7 said. That got me thinking. Just how meddlesome were the artifacts? Why had Holgatha agreed to transfer us to Sonicot, but no more? I'm glad you ran your analyses, I said. You did good, N7. Thank you, Commander. But about Baba Gobo joining us, the baboon already said no. You have added new factors, Commander. The Articles of Purple Tamika Honor, for one. The approaching rebel fleet is another element. Perhaps those new additions will sway the Starkians. I doubt it. My probability analysis reached a similar conclusion. Yet I cannot fathom any other reason as to why Dr. Sant gave us the speedster. Given that you're right about all this, I said. Yes, N7 said. I stood up and began to pace. Well... I said. Talk is cheap and whiskey costs money. Commander? asked N7. The proof will be in the reality once we reach home. Soon, one way or another, we'll have to test our theories on the field of battle. Our speedster, the Quarrel, proved itself many times over. The vessel was fast, had an extraordinary amount of anti-gravity plates, and lacked much in the way of shields, armored hull, or weapons. This thing was meant to run fast, run long, and outmaneuver enemies. It wasn't meant to fight in any but the lightest engagement. That allowed us to zip through star systems. Time after time we acted like a rabbit darting into its burrow, escaping any perusing vessels by beating them to the next jump gate. In time we left Jade League territory and raced through no man's land toward the solar system. Then our luck ran out in the Wolf 359 star system which was in the Leo constellation. The star was a cool red dwarf, one of the faintest known. The star's photosphere was a mere 2800 K. Wolf 359 also happened to be a flare star, throwing off sudden bursts of X-rays and gamma-ray radiation. In a straight line, the red dwarf was only 7.8 light-years from Earth. We were almost home. After shaking off the symptoms of jump, we accelerated toward the next gate. The alien ships didn't begin appearing from behind the various planets until we were 400,000 kilometers from the entrance gate. Commander, Ella said, you're not going to believe this. The bridge was small and cramped, with barely enough room for Ella, our present pilot, N7, Zoe, Rollo at weapons, and me in the center. I sat above them and could stare down at their panels. Look, Ella said. She typed on a hollow pad the keys visible in the air. Her effort produced another hollow image. 
The Red Dwarf system has two inner planets and five outer gas giants. From every world, ships began to swing around into view. The smallest and fastest shark-shaped vessels raced for the two jump gates. The one behind us and the one we aimed at. Starkians, I said. Correction, Ella said. Hidden Starkians. I nodded. Their appearance in these numbers and precision meant they had been hiding before we appeared. That would indicate one of two possibilities. Either they could see into another star system many light years away, or these ships had kept hidden for days, and more likely weeks. Had they been expecting us? I didn't like the implications. Incoming message, Commander, Ella said. Go ahead, I said. The hollow image shimmered as the star system disappeared. I found myself staring into Baba Gobo's ugly face. I can't believe it, Rollo said. Who did you expect? I asked. What? Rollo said. I pointed at the waiting hollow image of Baba Gobo. Rollo looked up at it. Oh, no, I wasn't talking about him. I mean the number of Starkian ships. How many are you counting? I asked. 1,523, Rollo said. My gut tightened. I don't want you to count starfighters, I said. I'm not, Rollo said. The number includes anything above a frigate, nothing smaller. My stomach pain increased. I scowled down at Rollo. Did Baba Gobo call all his Starkians together? Foreign vessel, Baba Gobo said, finally deciding to speak. You have entered Starkian space. I demand that you cease acceleration and begin breaking procedures. You must comply at once, or we will destroy you. I thought about it for all of two seconds. With over 1,500 starships, there was no way I could outrun every missile and beam. I'm going to talk to him, I told Ella. I thought you might, she said. Clearing my throat, I sat up. Baba Gobo, I said. This is Commander Creed speaking. Please explain your presence here. I waited for the transmission to reach him. It didn't take long. That would indicate the Starkian leader was in one of the nearest warships. Commander Creed, the baboon said. This is a highly pleasurable experience. It appears the Orange Tamika Doctor is a lohar of his word after all. What are you talking about? I asked warily. He did not inform you? Baba Gobo asked. Inform me of what? We must talk in private, which means in person, he said. You can forget about that, I said. If you remember, I came to your flagship once before. I don't plan on doing it again. If you wish, he said, snapping his fingers. I can destroy your vessel like that. If you do, you have no chance of gaining a new lease on life for your dying race. How can you say dying? the baboon asked. Do you see the number of warships I possess? Once your race had millions of vessels, I said. Now you're down to just this few. Your species lost out because you played the wanderers too long. I have a plan, though. It will save the Starkians, Orange to Micah, and humanity. Interesting, Baba Gobo said. Seer Sant said this would be so. When did he tell you this? Not him in person, but Seer Sant's emissary, Baron Visconti. I found myself blinking at the baboon. I didn't understand what was going on. What are you talking about? I asked. Meet with me, he said. I'm meeting with you now. Scratching his nose, Baba Gobo seemed to consider that. Finally, he said, Very well. Time is critical. We shall proceed. First, you must know that the Emperor's armada approaches Earth. Second, 
I will give you the broadest outline as to why I am here. After you left us in Epsilon Indy, I began to consider your words. You have the gift of persuasive speech, Commander. Few fighting men like you possess the ability. We are dying out. You are correct in saying that. Many years ago, my nephew Nagagobo went to the Jelk Corporation in order to prolong his fleet's existence. Instead, he brought about its destruction. My elders discussed this with me. We agreed that perhaps it was time to die with honor. I know, Baba Gobo said, holding up his slender fingers. You and the Lohars do not believe in Starkian honor. Yet Seer Sant does. But I leap ahead of the tale. The elders suggested that perhaps we should return to our old ways. You called it hit and run. In the oldest days we lived as open predators. That brought about the beginning of the Jade League. Wait a minute, I said. I thought it was to stop the Jelk. That came later, Baba Gobo said. In the early years the others feared us. We battled for many centuries, winning often but losing numbers. Then we made a critical error. Many elders have come to believe that the Forerunner artifacts had an agenda. The ancient machines aided the League with intelligence. They made the Lohars, Jitan, and Ilk smarter? I asked. No. The ancient machines gave out information. The artifacts informed the Lohars, the Jitan, Ilk, and others of our movements. Jade League fleets ambushed us many times. Our numbers rapidly dwindled. Finally, we disengaged from open predation, suing for peace. The League members never gave it to us, but in time their depredations lessened as they began to strive against the Jelk Corporation. Are you saying the Forerunner machines are helping Dr. Sant? I asked. After listening to his emissary, Baba Gobo said, I believe the artifacts are divided among themselves. They have relayed intelligence to Seer Sant. I think they have also told the Emperor choice bits of information. That's all very interesting, I said, stunned by these revelations. Now what are we going to do about it? Baba Gobo leaned forward. You have a secret weapon, do you not? That's right, I do, I said. It's called my brain. We have no more time for your boasting. You have something other than your arrogance. Why don't you tell me what you think I have, I said. I do not know, but I would like to. If I did have such a weapon, I asked, why would I tell you? It should be obvious, Baba Gobo said. To give me a reason to throw in the Starkian lot with orange, yellow, and green Tamaikas. And fight the Emperor? I asked. The baboon actually straightened, holding his head high. Yes, he said. You'll have to give me a minute, I said. I need to talk this over with my people. I grant you ten minutes, Baba Gobo said, trying to sound generous. After the time limit, my fleet will begin to maneuver to net you so we can capture your vessel and take your secret if we must. Right on, I said. Until then, Commander Creed out. Ella cut the connection so the hollow image vanished. Bemused, I exhaled and sank back into my cushioned chair. We didn't see that one coming, Ella commented from below. I scowled at her. I thought you did something to Sant's brain on Mars. He's supposed to help us, not throw us curveballs. Sant has helped, Ella said. My original effort has yielded great dividends. To begin with, through the Baron, Dr. Sant gave us the speedster. I ingested her words before looking at each of them in turn. Okay, I'm open to suggestions. What should we do? If the Starkians join Orange to Micah, Rollo said, we might have the numbers to beat the Emperor in a straight-up space battle. Even if we convince the Emperor to leave us in peace, Ella said, 
humanity is going to need allies to survive. This sounds like a golden opportunity for us. And seven? I asked. I foresee several problems, the android said. What does Dr. Sant know? What does the Emperor know? If we win, the battle will likely decimate both fleets. And why would that be bad? I asked. There will come a time when the Jelk defeat or lose to the present invaders? N7 said. Okay, I said. I see your point. If the Jelk win, they'll send the Saurian fleets back to the border. And if the Jelk lose, N7 said, the invaders will likely come to the border. So what are you suggesting? I asked. That we win the present struggle without mass destruction of warships, N7 said. Rollo laughed. That would be a mighty fine trick. How do you propose to do it? With our secret weapon, N7 said. We bargain with the Emperor. That has always been the plan. It is still the best one. Let's say we force the Emperor to back off, Rollo said. That still leaves Purple to Micah with a massive fleet. As Ella has suggested, that creates problems for us in the future. We must take one step at a time, N7 said. What do you think, Creed? Rollo asked. That both Ella and N7 are right, I said. Humanity needs allies, and we can't afford to decimate ourselves, knowing the Jelk or the invaders will come in time. Before we do anything, though, we need the Starkian fleet. We have to have enough numbers to make the Emperor and his admirals pause long enough to listen to me. Can you trust Baba Gobo with our secret? Ella asked. I flexed my fingers and rolled my shoulders. That was the question, wasn't it? Let's put the baboon back online. I said. We're about to find out. Ah, Baba Gobo said, as if tasting a rare and wonderful vintage. His dark eyes glowed with lust. This is amazing. You are a scoundrel, Commander Creed. An interstellar rascal, he said, heaping Starkian praises upon me. I sat in my command chair, watching his hollow image. I just informed the baboon that I held the key articles from the Purple Tamika Hall of Honor in Zalambra on Horus. You are a thief, Baba Gobo added. Star Viking, I said, correcting him. I am unfamiliar with the term. When you look at me, I said, that's what you're seeing. Baba Gobo rubbed his hands. Yes. You hold a powerful secret weapon. For safekeeping, you will now deliver it into my keeping. Is that what you think? I asked. Your vessel is fast, but it is under-armored and possesses few weapons. Anyone can take the articles from you. When you say anyone, I said, I hope you realize that doesn't mean you or any other alien. Yes, yes, he said. You are a vainglorious beast. Man, I said, interrupting him. I'm a vainglorious man, human, person of high intelligence. You do well to remember that. Don't goad him, Ella whispered to me. I made a slicing motion with my finger at her. She got the message and zipped her lips. On the hollow image, Baba Gobo became oily in his manner. Commander Creed, you must be reasonable. The Starkians hold the key to victory. Wrong, I said. Commander Creed and his Star Vikings hold the key. No, he said angrily. Have you counted the number of my warships? Sure have, I said. It's an impressive amount. We can easily destroy your vessel. That's true, I said. Since you understand this, you realize that you must bring the Articles of Honor to me at once. With a smirk on my face, I leaned back in my chair, staring at him. What is this you're doing? Baba Gobo asked. I disapprove of your leers and grimaces. We have serious business at hand. Creed, Ella pleaded. Please don't goad him. This time I ignored her altogether. 
I am ordering my ships to ready their weapons, Baba Gobo told me. Let me ask you a question, I said. There is no more time. Decide. If you destroy my ship, what happens to the Articles of Honor? Baba Gobo blinked several times. Then his scowl deepened. Good, I said. I see you're finally thinking about this. The Articles will be gone, he said, and you will be dead. Then we Starkians shall leave this part of the Orion Arm. Good luck with that, I said. You must realize the Purple Tamika Lohars will know what you did. Who will tell them? You? I do not think so, as you shall be dead. Yes, I'll be dead. That's my point, he said. How will the Purple Lohars ever learn of our deed? How do they learn many things? I asked. In time, the Forerunner artifacts will tell them. Then nothing will protect the Starkians from the vengeance of the Lohars. Because of your present stubbornness, Baba Gobo said, humanity's fate is death. I shook my head. The Purple Tamika Lohars will never forgive you your raid on Horus, Baba Gobo said. I don't care about their forgiveness. I just want their words of honor that they'll leave humanity and Earth alone. Baba Gobo stared at me. Slowly he began to nod. You are a clever... I'm sure he almost said beast, but he stopped himself. You are very clever, Commander. Coming from you, I said. That is high praise indeed. I'm glad you can recognize that. Good. Now let's get down to it. We're keeping the Articles of Honor. You're coming with us to just outside the solar system. Let's make it Alpha Centauri. Baba Gobo pursed his lips in a baboon monkey manner. Then he looked away, sighing deeply. Finally he shook his head before regarding me once more. Yes, Baba Gobo said. We will do as you say. The Starkians have entered the lists once more ready to do battle in order to win our rightful place in the Orion Arm. It was the grandest speech I'd ever heard a Starkian make. Afterward, the quarrel headed for the jump gate. Behind us, the Starkian fleet began to maneuver into its battle formation. Two days later, we made it to the solar system. The crew cheered and everyone slapped each other on the back. To make N7 feel like he was part of us, which he most certainly was, I made sure to pummel the androids back until he finally asked me to stop. Both Ella and Zoe gave him hugs. Soon the quarrel orbited Mars. Diana and Murad Bey waited down there in the dome. I'll tell you what this is going to be, I told the assembled people, both assault troopers and Earth Council delegates. This is like the Sea Battle of Lepanto in 1571. Back then the Ottoman Turks tried to smash the assembled Christian fleet. The Turks had been making sweeping conquests, and this was Europe's answer. Papal ships, Venetian and Spanish, combined to face the dreaded enemy. Face the glorious conquerors, Murad Bey declared. I glanced at him. Yeah, I get it, you have a different outlook on the event. My only point is that the papal commanders, the Venetians and the Spanish, all quarreled with each other like crazy up until the cannons began firing. On the day of battle, they put aside their differences just long enough to win a smashing victory. We have to figure out a way to get Lohars and Starkians to listen to us so I can talk sense to the Emperor. That may be more difficult than you realize, Diana told me. Probably, I said. But that's our goal. I also think we humans will have to take all our warships to the battlefield. We're going to be the final reserve. That's if it comes down to a slugfest. It's all or nothing for us. It's too late to run away. If we tried that, the Emperor's approaching armada would just chase us down. Can you really make the Emperor see reason? Ella asked. If not, I'll destroy the Purple Tamika Articles of Honor, I said. That will only enrage them, Murad Bey said. They will boil with fury at humanity and seek vengeance. That's how you would react, I said. It might not be what a tiger will do. 
Maybe it will dispirit them. They'll fight listlessly afterward. We must not destroy each other, N7 said. The Jelk or the invaders will eventually return to the border region. Why is that a given? Diana asked him. Maybe the Jelk and the Corporation invaders will destroy each other, just as your worried will do here. Good point, I told Diana. Anyway, Baba Gobo sent us a message a day ago. The Emperor's battle fleet is two weeks out. It's massive, likely fifty percent bigger than our combined force. The Starkians will run away for sure, Rollo said. I'm not finished, I said. We have to buy time. The bulk of orange, yellow, and green Tamikas is three weeks out. I have to convince the Starkians to engage in hit-and-run raids in order to slow down the Emperor's armada. I suggest all Earth's warships go out and help in this task. Risky, Diana said. It is that, I said. It's also our only hope. Is anyone opposed to the idea? I scanned the strained faces staring at me. No one opposed. Very well, I said. I'm giving us two days to get ready. Then our fleet moves out to Alpha Centauri to link with the Starkians. What is to prevent them from rushing into the solar system and holding our freighters hostage? Diana asked. Not a damn thing, I said. Other than Starkian integrity. You can't be serious, Rollo said. If they lacked honor, I said, they'd never fight in the first place. So you hope, Rollo said. I studied my massive friend. Nodding, I said, Yeah, I hope. Rollo crossed his arms but didn't say anything more. Is that it? I asked. Or does someone else want to add something? No. The meeting ended on the sour note. The struggle against the Emperor's crusading armada was about to begin. Chapter 30 Rollo, N7, and Zoe Artemis stayed aboard the Quarrel. Their task was to keep the Purple Tamika Articles of Honor in human hands. They parked the ship in lunar orbit near the weapons systems of the Moon Fortress. I went out with a Starkian strike force. Baba Gobo had decided to deploy three hit-and-run flotillas. Our task was to slow down the crusading armada's advance. We had to gain time for the rebel fleet to maneuver between Earth and the Emperor. Earth didn't have much to add to the flotillas, but what we did have we used. I brought three Sanakat attack cruisers, joining Kakaro's strike force. Our attack cruisers were teardrop-shaped vessels with powerful particle beam generators. These had heavy mounts, giving the particle beams extra range. Because of our low speed, we joined the strike force's reserves, 37 Starkian beam ships. Strikers composed the force's main element, 153 whale-shark-shaped vessels. They were bigger than the beam ships and bigger than our attack cruisers. The strikers carried drones and moved fast, with amazing acceleration and deceleration abilities. Eight days and five jumps brought us to the Beta Tarn system. A G-class star pumped out normal light. A thick interior asteroid belt gave us the perfect ambush site. Starkian scouts had returned with news. One of the main arms of the Emperor's armada was on its way. It would be coming through the jump gate near the star. The problem for our attack cruisers and maybe the accompanying beam ships would be the exit, the jump gate we'd use to reach Beta Tarn. The gate was near a Pluto-like world in the distant outer system. Two Jovian gas giants provided the only terrain between the inner asteroid belt and the Pluto-like rock. The strikers raced for the asteroid belt, my attack cruisers lagged behind the faster beam ships, following the forward elements the best we could. Thirty-eight hours later, Ella told me, There's a signal coming through. I nodded. It's Kakaro, sir, she said. He's ordering the beam ships to hide at the outer edge of the belt. Lohar warheads just went off near the inner stargate. Kakaro believes the enemy will be coming through soon in force. If that is so, he plans to bring the Lohars to us. Signal our acceptance of the order, I said. For the present, I was content to listen to the Starkians. They helped the last humans, so I'd do my part the best I could. 
Along with the beam ships, our attack cruisers braked hard, slowing our velocity. Five hours later, my three ships waited behind an icy asteroid the size of Australia. Before I relate what happened next, I should point out that space battles were much different from old naval wars on Earth. There, even in fights between carriers, planes were hours away from their targets, not days. Here, one made a plan and executed it, and waited a day or three to see if it would work or not. The stellar distances mandated the time delay. Fed with data from the forward strikers, we watched the Starkian warships spew their drones. The drones were slender needles, dark as sin, made of a composite material hard to spot. The missiles used cold propellants, which meant they lacked speed until a final hot burn. That was clever, as the cold propellants would help keep the drones invisible from enemy sensors. Three hours later, as I studied the main screen, the advance arm of the crusading armada began to pour through the gate. Warship after warship entered the system. The Lohars had mobs of attack cruisers, big carriers, and masses of pursuit destroyers. In a short amount of time, 420 warships deployed. That's too many, Ella said. Kakaro should order us to run while we have a chance. No, I said. One way or another, we have to buy humanity a chance. Unless Sant arrives in time, the Earth freighters are doomed. You have to bargain with the Emperor, Creed. You won't be able to do that if you die in this star system. N7 can bargain with the Emperor just as well as me and Rollo can take my place for the other task. I'm no longer invaluable. Ella didn't respond to that. She watched the main screen. We all did. The Lohars were good, maneuvering their numbers with precision. That made us even queasier than before. Our Starkian allies didn't move like that. Clearly we were going against the best, personnel who obviously knew what they were doing. Finally, en masse, the large enemy fleet began to head for the asteroid belt. Even with their numbers, the strikers managed to remain hidden among the asteroids near the inner edge. They reminded me of American colonials fighting the British redcoats on the road to Concord. As the Lohars approached, the Starkians maneuvered stealthily, heading deeper into the rock field. The striker pilots used intervening objects to mask their movement from the enemy. And something gave them away, likely an old-fashioned heat signature. The Lohar Admiral reacted, sending a wide-beam message. I recognized her. It was Admiral Saris, looking as stiff as ever. Foreign vessels, Admiral Saris announced. We are here under Jade League orders. The Emperor and his court has decreed the humans a walking plague. We will annihilate them from existence. Whoever stands against us will share their fate. I wondered if Kaka Ro would answer. He didn't. Neither did I. The pursuit destroyers led the way, followed by the Lohar attack cruisers and then the carriers. It took hours as they accelerated for the belt. We waited behind our asteroid as the other reserve vessels waited behind theirs. What could twenty-seven Starkian beam ships and three Earth cruisers do against the Lohar fleet? The strikers needed to whittle down the enemy. Hours later, Kakaro's first move paid dividends. Cold, dark Starkian drones burned hot. Because of the Lohar's acceleration, the missiles were almost on top of them. Even so, the Lohars were ready. Saris had seen enough to know that something was up. Beams and destroyers' point defense cannons took out ninety percent of the first wave. The trouble for the Tigers was the Starkian missiles kept coming. Kakaro clearly believed in a hard first strike. Enough drones struck Lohar warships to cause massive detonations all along the line. Seventeen pursuit destroyers exploded. Nineteen more took damage. Five of those kept coming. Something inside them no longer worked. Escape pods jettisoned from those five. The other damaged destroyers began to decelerate. I expected Admiral Saris to order the rest of her warships to attack vigorously. These were Lohars, the headlong attack artists. Maybe Kakaro knew a few things about Lohars. The Cold Needle drones had proven a clever tactic. Faced with unknown and unseen assailants, the Lohar fleet slowed its velocity. 
Our sensors showed them scanning hard. Tiger drones burned brightly, racing ahead of the main fleet. In such a fashion, Saris crawled into the rock field. The battle changed demeanor then, turning slow motion as the Starkians played drone games with the Lohars. This wasn't like our asteroid belt in the solar system. This belt had an incredible mass of rocks and debris. Because of that, stealth counted for as much as speed and firepower. Ambushes constantly occurred. The Starkians retreated, leaving hundreds of dark missile surprises. The Lohars destroyed most of the enemy's drones, but kept taking hits nonetheless. This went on for an amazing two days. We waited back here to do our part with the beam ships when the time came. Finally, Kakaro sent us a pulse message. I expected the Starkian Lord to demand our firepower. The Lohars kept pursuing. Instead, the Lord said, Run for the distant jump gate. Try to lure the Lohars after you. Smart, Ella said. I shook my head. I came here to fight. Ella swiveled around to face me. You came to slow down the Emperor's advance. We're doing that. The Starkians have done it, not us, I said. We're here. We're part of the effort. Maybe the Starkians wouldn't have come if you'd hung back at Earth. Well, now we need to save our ships for the next star system. Kakaro must realize that as well. I could see Ella's logic, and I wanted to live. Finally, along with the beam ship captains, I acknowledged the message by accelerating at full speed for the distant jump gate. Kakaro was clever. I'd never seen the Starkians in their element before, making plans their way. Twenty-seven beam ships fled for the distant gate. Three attack cruisers did likewise. I shouldn't have been surprised Admiral Saris singled us out. She hailed our accelerating cruisers. I refused to speak with the Lohar. After a time, Saris sent a wide-beam message. Renegade Lohars, we have marked your ship's registries. I am putting you on the Emperor's prescription list. Even if you reach the jump gate, you are doomed. Yeah, I could see what was going on. Our attack cruisers had been built on Sanakat, the reason for Admiral Saris's mistake about who we were. After the message ended, a mass of T-missiles appeared near us and the running beam ships. Our particle beams destroyed some. We'd been waiting for the tactic. For just such a reason, I'd also seeded proximity mines behind us. Some of those detonated, annihilating T-missiles, but not all. Three thermonuclear warheads exploded. Get ready, Dimitri shouted. Our shield went dark as the electromagnetic field around the attack cruiser absorbed the heat and deadly X-rays and gamma rays. Admiral Saris wasn't through with us or with the beam ships. For over two days, her vessels had faced dark drones streaking from cover. Lohar rage must have built during the time. Maybe Kakaro had counted on that. It was a big asteroid belt, meaning the Lohars were already at far teleportation range from us. In any case, more T-missiles appeared, but the beam ships and our cruisers kept raying them. As another thermonuclear detonation flared Nova White on our screen, I began to see another aspect of Kakaro's cunning. Our attack cruisers and the beam ships had heavier armor and better shields than the strikers did. If we took the brutal hits now and depleted the Lohar stocks of teleporting missiles, afterward the strikers could flee without worrying about the same thing happening to them. Fortunately, we had a few critical advantages in this contest. T-missile technology was chancy at best. The longer the teleportation range, the less likely the warhead would appear in the exact targeted location. We tried to put more separation between Admiral Saris and us, as we were already near their operational limit. The other thing was this. Before a T-missile appeared, it created a hazy image in space. Then its form became distinct, and finally it solidified into existence. The first haziness, like a heat wave on blacktop, was a telltale giveaway. It allowed our gunners to fire before the warhead could ignite. Then all our advantages vanished as a T-missile exploded a mere three kilometers from one of our vessels. Given the Admiral's present distance from us, that was a fantastically lucky break for the Lohars. 
At the blast, the nearest attack cruiser's shield buckled and overloaded, going down. The rest of the nuclear discharge tore the ship's armored hull apart. It must have also done something to the vessel's core. A furious internal explosion sent a geyser of light and radiation out of the craft's exhaust ports. Then the attack cruiser began to tumble end over end, heading away from us. Ella tried to raise the stricken crew. They must have all been dead already. Expend our minds, I shouted. Seed them everywhere. The Lohar T-missile assault continued. Two Starkian beam ships blew apart. Another took crippling hits, its accelerating rush slowing down. Another round of T-missiles finished it off. Our particle beams rayed. Mines raced outward in all directions. Another round of exploding warheads poured massive doses of radiation against our shield, enough leaking through the armored hull to affect us. Fortunately, we wore our symbiotic suits. The living skin seeped anti-radiation drugs into our bodies. My attack cruiser still functioned, although several ship systems began to go offline. We accelerated, but so did our Lohar tormentors. That meant Admiral Saris's warships in the asteroid belt came after us. That was their mistake. The Lohar vessels raced smack into waiting Starkian needle missiles. The drones burned hot and detonated. Twenty-eight Lohar warships blew apart. Others took damage. For the next several hours, Admiral Saris turned her attention onto the nearby snipers. An eighth the number of T-missiles popped near us. The mines helped destroy most of them. Our gunners had also become expert now, recognizing the telltale shimmer sooner than ever. As the objects solidified, particle beams already chewed into them. Nine hours later, our two attack cruisers and the surviving beam ships gained enough separation that no more T-missiles appeared. Far back in the inner asteroid belt, the Starkian strikers burst into open space. Kakaro made his run for the portal. Are there any T-missiles attacking them? I asked. Ella watched her panel. Not yet, she said. By the time we reached the jump gate, she hadn't seen any more of the deadly Lohar T-missiles strike the Starkian vessels. It looked as if Kakaro was going to make it to the next star system with us. We'd hurt Admiral Saris's fleet more than she had hurt us. Unfortunately, the Lohars still outnumbered us. We accelerated through the next system. It possessed many jump gates, branching off to various stars. We raced for the gate that would take us into the Wolf 359 system. In time, we entered Wolf 359. Advance Guard Orange to Mica battlecruisers waited there, 110 altogether. We signaled them. Seven hours later, the strikers came through. Kakaro told Baron Visconti, who commanded the advance guard, that Admiral Saris was hot behind them. The Starkian Lord proved right. Purple Lohar warships began to appear in the Wolf 359 system. With T-missiles, Visconti hit the entering warships, obliterating all nine enemy vessels. Time passed as we waited for more of them. Five and a half hours after the slaughter, enemy drones slid through the gate. They exploded with thermonuclear warheads. Thirty minutes after that, more Purple Tomica drones appeared. From 300,000 kilometers away, Visconti let them advance. Finally, another group of Purple Tomica pursuit destroyers came through. Once more, the Barons saturated the jump gate area with T-missiles. It was a devastating tactic. The advancing purple drones used heavy jamming equipment, but it didn't matter this time. Soon, Starkey and Needle missiles destroyed the ECM drones. We were doing it. For two more days, Baron Visconti and Kaka Rowe held off Admiral Saris. The purple Lohar commander must have feared to send the bulk of her fleet through the jump gate into the Wolf 359 system. Then a messenger ship came through our back gate, signaling us. The messenger brought news. Using other gates and star systems, the Purple Tomica fleet had gained reinforcements from the Emperor. Using different jump gates, Ceres worked her way around. It appeared she was trying to trap us in the Wolf 359 star system by coming in from behind. We saw the danger. Every ship accelerated for the exit. 
As our ships left Wolf 359, the last trooper on my attack cruiser recovered from radiation poisoning. Unfortunately, some of our vessel's weapons systems no longer worked. I learned that the trick to this kind of jump gate battle was to funnel the enemy's advance. If you stopped her too cold at one particular gate, she would go around a different way. Then it became a guessing game. Our strategy called for hit-and-run attacks. We tried to whittle them down just enough so they took longer. We didn't want to damage their flotilla so much that the fleet came at us from a different set of jump gates. Maybe Visconti had miscalculated by hammering them too hard at the Wolf 359 entrance gate. At this point, the Baron played a hunch. He met with Kaka Rowe. I attended the battle meeting. Visconti told us his father had once been Admiral Saris's chief of staff. That had been many years ago. Saris used to eat at the Visconti home and discuss tactics with the young Baron-to-be. After having studied a star chart, Visconti assured us Saris would try to sneak through by going around to Ross 128. Instead of splitting off and guarding each gate with minimal force, we rushed our beefed-up strike force to Ross 128. The system possessed three gates. The Red Dwarf Star was faint to the naked eye. It had 15% of the sun's mass, but it generated energy so slowly that it only had 0.036% of the sun's visible luminosity. Ross 128 was 10.89 light-years from Earth in a straight line, but not part of the closest jump routes. Ceres would rather travel farther for a better position than battle head-to-head, -head, Visconti said. She is an artist of maneuver. It turned out that the Baron knew his opponent. Saris entered the system a mere three hours after we did. That put us too far from each other to attack right away. Her reinforced fleet had far more warships than we did. But if Kaka Rose's escape from the Beta Tarn asteroid belt was any indicator, the Admiral's ships likely didn't have masses of T-missiles. Of course, she might have received more from supply ships. Visconti didn't think so. Saris used speed whenever she could. The problem was that our side only had a minimal number of T-missiles left. The Baron had used most of them in the Wolf 359 system. After gaining Kaka Rowe's agreement, Visconti decided to bluff the Admiral. He teleported every T-missile he had left, sending them as far as he could. Then the drones accelerated for Ceres's approaching fleet. None of our T-missiles had a chance of doing damage, of course. That hadn't been the point. Before the flock of T-missiles reached the enemy fleet, Admiral Saris's ships maneuvered, turning hard. She wasn't going to break and accelerate back to the gate she'd used to enter. Instead, she headed for the third gate in order to escape us. Amazing, Dimitri said. Admiral Saris has more ships, yet she flees. That is sound tactical doctrine, N7 said. The Baron would not expend his T-missiles like that unless he had a vast supply. Visconti's strike also predicates a lack of T-missiles on the Admiral's part. Ceres does not wish to sustain massive T-missile damage from us before entering beam range. Thus she retreats until such time as she can replenish the number of her T-missiles. It seems too elementary a tactic to work, Dimitri said. I would realize the Baron was trying to bluff, close in, and smash us. Saris's actions tell us that she is not Dmitri Rostov, N7 replied. She wishes to preserve her ships for the great battle. In order to seal the bluff, Visconti had us accelerate after the fleeing enemy, increasing our strike force's velocity. Only after the last enemy warships departed the Ross 128 system did we begin breaking. It was time to go back the way we had come. Baron Visconti's hunch had paid off. Even better, our strike force had slowed down the enemy advance to Earth. Had the other strike forces done likewise? Or was the crusading armada knocking on Earth's door? It was time to find out. Chapter 31 It turned out that two task forces fought masterful delaying actions. The third perished but gave a hard fight. Three strikers from the destroyed force raced back to give an account of the battle. The senior captain believed the Lohars had been surprised at Starkian ferocity. 
Although the way had been open for the Lohar flotilla, they had paused and sent messenger ships back to the main armada. I believe the Admiral wished for new instructions, the senior striker captain told us. One last ship remains at the farther gate. It will arrive to tell us when the Lohars enter the star system. Another day passed in anxious waiting. Finally, the forward elements of the rebel fleet reached Alpha Centauri. After that, all hell broke loose. Elements of the Emperor's main crusading armada crashed into the rebel fleet in the Wolf 359 system. For a day, it looked as if every ship we had needed to race there. Baba Gobo readied the Starkians. Kaka Ro suggested a surprise rush to take the Emperor from a back system. Baron Visconti had other ideas. Before anyone could implement one of the plans, Lohar pride and honor changed the equation. The Emperor sent messenger ships to the rebels. Soon enough, Sant listened to the request and agreed. The Emperor's forward admirals backed out of Wolf 359. The rebel fleet poured through, rushing to bring everything to Alpha Centauri. That's no way to run a war, Rollo said. The Emperor should have pushed his advantage. Agreed, N7 said. Undecipherable Lohar honor is one of the reasons the Jelk Corporation has successfully waged war against the Jade League for these many years. Only later did I learn what had happened. It came out during the grand meeting on Sant's flagship, a gigantic mauler. The Emperor made a deal with Sant. Felix Rex Logos would let Sant bring his entire fleet through Wolf 359, if later the Seer agreed to let the Crusading Armada through into the Alpha Centauri star system. We will wrestle our differences with honor, the Emperor had said. The winner will rule the Lohar Empire. Sant had agreed to the deal. He brought the rebel fleet to Alpha Centauri, the massed might of orange, yellow, and green Tamikas, along with lesser houses. Combined together with the last Starkian fleet in existence, it made for a vast force. The next several days saw hurried deployments, last-minute repairs, and the great meeting between the leaders. I went, taking Ella with me. The Lohars didn't like N7, so for once I left him behind. Sant had eight maulers. Orange Tamika loved giant vessels. The round ships lacked the dreadnought's sheer mass. Nothing had ever matched the hyperspace vessels. But a mauler was five times bigger than a Jelk battle jumper. The super ship boasted immense laser cannons, and it could deploy hundreds of starfighters. The great meeting took place on a stage for Lohar plays. I sat in the front row. Baba Gobo crouched nearby on a low seat. After the seats filled up, Dr. Sant walked onto the stage. He'd changed since I'd seen him last, looking older, more weighed down with responsibility. He wore an orange toga and moved with serene authority. I won't bore you with the long-winded speeches. Lohars love to talk. They loved it even more at big meetings where everyone should have discussed strategy and tactics. Sant launched into a monologue that lasted hours, talking about ancient history, religion, customs, and seemingly everything but the coming battle. After Sant's introduction, others talked. Finally, Baba Gobo glanced at me. I shrugged. What could we do? The tigers blabbered endlessly. Only toward the end, as even Lohars began to nod off, did Sant stand up again. He finally opened it up to military suggestions. I pinched myself, waiting to hear about subtle maneuvers and clever tactics. Shockingly, most of the Lohars talked about courage and standing at one's post to the bitter end. We must trick them, Baba Gobo shouted. We must whittle them down with cunning. At the Starkians' outburst, the auditorium grew silent. Seer Sant stood up once more. The acolyte who had been talking sat down. Baba Gobo, the Lohar said. This is a matter of honor. Hard fighting will win the day, not sly ruses. The Emperor's forces outnumber us, Baba Gobo said. Yet we will still win, Sant said. This I know. 
How will we win? The Starkian asked. Through valor, Sant said. The Lohars roared and pumped their fists into the air. Baba Gobo shrank back against his chair. In that moment I feared the Starkians might leave the Grand Fleet. I stood up and motioned to Sant. Commander Creed, the Lohar said. Do you wish to add a word? I do, I said. I think we must find a way to defeat the Crusading Armada without destroying their ships or ours. How can you do this? Sant asked. Will you threaten to destroy the Purple Tamika Articles of Honor? The auditorium of Lohar strained to hear my words. If I must, I said. A low groan went through the chamber. Sant held up his hands. The noise died down. We will fight with honor. It is to be seen if the Emperor of Purple Tamika can fight without a soul. Once Commander Creed brings the wrath of the Creator down on his head, then we of orange, yellow, and green Tamikas will destroy the beasts among us. Again the Lohars roared with approval. Who do you mean by beasts? I asked, bristling. Those formerly of purple Tamika, Sant said, sounding surprised by my question. Oh, I said. Once I destroyed the articles, Purple Tamika would lack a soul. By Lohar logic, they would become beasts. Yes, of course, I said. Sitting, I leaned past Ella and whispered to Baba Gobo, It sounds like a clever plan. The Lohars are seldom clever, Baba Gobo whispered. But they do like to fight. Will you fight? I asked the Starkian leader. He stared at me with his red eyes. Yes, I will fight. Sitting normally again, I thought about Sant's overall plan. It had seemed foolish to grant the Emperor the opportunity to freely enter the Alpha Centauri system, yet the two Lohars had given their word to each other. Felix had let Sant race through Wolf 359, now Sant would let the Emperor set up here. It reminded me of the old-time chariot lords of ancient China. The nobility of that era had fought on their state-of-the-art horse-drawn battle carts. Just like medieval French knights, the Chinese of that time had set great store by chivalry. In the story I'm referring to, a noble with a tactical advantage behind a river had thrown away his gain. The opposing king told him it wouldn't be chivalrous to attack him while he forded his chariots across the river. The noble graciously allowed the king to bring his host across and deploy. They fought a righteous battle, and the honorable noble lost the fight and his life. I hoped we weren't making the same mistake. Sant ended the so-called strategy session by telling everyone that in a battle for the Lohar Empire we had to adhere to the ancient traditions. I could see what he was doing. Sant wanted to keep his hands clean by having me do the dirty work. He said I'd make the Creator angry for destroying Purple Tamika's articles of honor. I hoped that was just an expression. Even as Sant made his last, long-winded monologue, a high-ranking official raced into the auditorium. The seer stopped talking. Every eye turned to the official. The Lohar said in a higher voice than normal, The first ships of the Emperor's Armada have entered the star system. A combined sigh went through the chamber. Afterward, it only took Sant another hour to finish his talk. Chapter 32 In a straight line, Alpha Centauri AB was 4.37 light-years from Earth. It was a binary star system as two stars orbited a common point. Alpha Centauri A had 110% the mass of the Sun, while Sen B had 90.7% the mass. A third star, Proxima Centauri, had some gravitational effect upon the system. It was in an orbit 400 times the distance that Neptune circled Sol. That meant Proxima Centauri had a negligible effect upon the coming encounter. The sheer gargantuan size of the Emperor's crusading armada caused me to question his sanity. 
Surely Felix Rex Logos had called in Lohar warships from all the provinces of the Empire. He must have stripped defensive frontiers of every mobile formation he had. No wonder he'd allowed Dr. Sant to bring the rebel fleet through Wolf 359. By fixing his enemy's location, the Emperor could crush him permanently, not having to worry about pirate formations in the years to come from those who had escaped. The Emperor's only fear might be rebel sneak attacks as his ships came through jump gates. By his nobility, Sant had thrown away that possibility. The Emperor must have had three times our numbers and four times our tonnage. This was going to be a slaughter. Yet the vast numbers on our side meant the rebels would inflict telling damage to the Imperial fleet. The Emperor's commanders brought the mass forward in three distinct sections. As if the fleet was a legion, the commanders had separated it into three waves. Huge bombards lumbered toward us. Bigger than orange to mica maulers, the bombards had massively armored hulls and double-strength shields. They could take a pounding and deal one. Their weakness was a lack of speed. In such a mass battle as this, though, I doubted they would need quick acceleration. Surprisingly, the Emperor's commanders had spread out the bombards, each ship hundreds of kilometers from its neighbors. If we launched T-missiles at them, we wouldn't be able to take out clusters of vessels, just one big vessel at a time. The next square had battle and attack cruisers in daunting numbers. Thousands approached behind the bombards. That square could have faced our fleet alone and likely come out victorious. Carriers and pursuit destroyers made up the final square. Taken altogether, it was far too much for us to face and win. Three times the ships meant the Creator sided with them, didn't it? The old quip said that God fought on the side with the biggest battalions. Well, that would be the Crusading Armada. We approached the enemy in a vast globular formation shaped like a teardrop. The bulbous part faced the Emperor's bombards. At our lengthy council of war, we had decided to use massed counterfire to destroy any teleporting missiles. It was riskier than our enemy's plan, but could prove superior if we could wipe out the appearing T-missiles before they detonated. Then we could strike the bombards with our concentration and supposedly defeat them in detail. Counting the amazing numbers, I realized that a space war shouldn't ever come down to such a grand encounter in one star system. Yet here were most of the Lohar military vessels, representing over 80% of the Tiger Empire's firepower. If we fought it, it would surely cripple Lohar fleet strength for decades, maybe forever, depending on who struck next and with what strength. Maybe the Emperor could see that. Maybe he thought the Armada's size would astound us. Dr. Sant understood that a battle here today would cripple Lohar military power. It would probably also mean our annihilation. Baron Visconti understood, as did the other rebel leaders. Baba Gobo dreaded the coming fight, yet the Starkian had become too proud to flee. This was a historic moment, and it occurred right next door to Earth. Wasn't that awesome? No, it was horrible. The two fleets moved through the Alpha Centauri system. Seen one way, it was majestic. Looked at another, it could mean doom for millions of combatants and then the final death of humanity. It was time to make my play. Our side counted on it. I was back in the quarrel with my people. The speedster stayed in the tail area of the globular formation. With the permission of Seer Sant and his leaders, I now radioed the Emperor's flagship. As I sat in my command chair above the bridge crew, I tried to compose myself. For once, I wanted to be formal and correct. What if Felix Rex Logos refused to speak to me, a supposed animal? Would I have to destroy articles of Purple Tamika Honor on a wide screen for everyone to witness? I didn't want to, but if I had to, I would most certainly do it. Get ready, Creed, Ella said. The Emperor's comm officer has agreed to our request. I told myself to relax, breathing in and out. All our hard work, all our fighting and dying, it concentrated into this single moment. Before me, the hollow image wavered and then solidified. I stared into the face of Felix Rex Logos. He had wide features, but no longer had white fur on his face. Fur coloring, I thought to myself. He wants to look spry and powerful. 
He hadn't done anything about his bulldog jowls. He wore a large device on his head. Oh, it was a purple crown with red jewels sparkling on the points. His orange eyes shone with purpose, and a purple collar jutted up to his chin. Greetings, Emperor of the Purple to Michael Lohars, I said. I am the Emperor of all the Lohars, he said in a ringing voice. We broadcast to everyone. I guess Felix had his reasons for doing that, and we had ours. Maybe he wanted to show his tigers what a beast I was, a raving monster. Did he know yet that I'd raided his Hall of Honor? He had to, right? Why otherwise agree to speak with me? You were the Emperor of all, I said. Then you made terrible decisions. One of those was to send others to do your dirty work of nuking and poisoning my planet. For that, you're about to lose your crown. Who is this beast I see before me? He asked with a royal sneer. He'd seen me before. This was play-acting on his part. Whatever you think I am, I said. At least I'm not the reigning monarch who let his Hall of Honor fall into a Star Viking's hands. He stiffened, and his orange eyes shined with murder lust. You lie, animal, he said in a hoarse voice. I could have taken this a number of different ways. I decided on a direct approach. With a lazy move, I picked up an old spearhead. Using it, I scratched my cheek. The twelve-thousand-year-old weapon had a distinctive mark on its metal, a stamp with a lohar flower that looked like a claw. Upon seeing the spearhead, Felix Rex logos roared. After he finished showing off his wrath, he leaned forward with his eyes blazing. What is that you're holding? Oh, this? I asked, holding up the ancient spearhead. It's something I picked up in Zalambra during my touchdown on Horus. It was quite an evening. Lots of fire and screaming vestals. We had a jolly old time, you can believe that. You, he raved, pointing at me with a wicked claw. You dared enter our sacred hall of honor? You'd better believe it, I said, remembering how Lohars had beamed my dad's shuttle. This was payback, even if it didn't bring back the dead. I wanted to prolong this moment forever, but I knew I had to strike while Felix's emotions raged hottest. I'll tell you what, Mr. Emperor, I said. If you like, you can send over a team of representatives to examine our loot. Let them see if we have your precious articles or not. I imagine everyone is willing to wait before we start the bloodshed. Come and see just how much of your honor I'm holding. Felix Rex Logo stared at me. I could feel his fury, his rage and impotence. I loved it. I wanted to shove his face into it and say, Bad kitty, bad, very bad, then kick him in the ass and send him sprawling onto the carpet before I hacked him to death. As if it had been rusted shut, he opened his mouth. Slowly, his lips moved. Like a dead man, he asked, If I halt our advance, will your ships halt too? Yes, I said. He stared at me longer. You, a man, can speak for the rebels? In this instance, I can speak for Seer Sant, the orange to Micah Lohar who rode the artifact from the portal planet to the solar system. I can speak for him because I know the artifact's name and rode inside the ancient construct. The Emperor's eyes bulged outward. He strove to speak. Finally, he said, I will send Purple Tamika acolytes to see these articles. Just make sure there isn't any she feng aboard, I said. I'm tired of killing your exploding assassins. Felix Rex Logos's mouth went slack. He shuddered, I think, with fury. A moment later, their comm officer cut the connection. Why did you have to add the last bit, Commander? Ella said. You're risking too much. Maybe, I said in a thick voice. We'll let the outcome decide whether I went too far or not. As the massed fleets waited on either end of Alpha Centauri, a single purple Lohar shuttle accelerated from their side. It was a big craft, 
It took the vessel twenty-two hours to reach the globular and slow down. Three hours later, we matched velocities. A boarding tube snaked between the two craft. Three dignitaries marched through it and entered our airlock. I waited to greet them with N-7 on one side and Rollo on the other. My gun hand rested on my forty-four. If they played us false, I wanted to blow their bodies apart the old-fashioned way. The hatch opened and three old Lohars stared at me. The first was big with hunched shoulders, wearing an admiral's uniform. The second looked like a Lohar scholar with a tall collar and square hat. The last was the acolyte with a long purple robe. He trembled from age and had roomy eyes. You are the beast, Creed? the acolyte asked in a brittle voice. His name was Divine Griffin. Let's get one thing straight right away, I said. You don't call me beast or animal, and I won't call you stupid before I knock you to the floor. We are here under truce, Divine Griffin said. Would you dare to break such a solemn compact? I won't break the truce, I said. Then you must not threaten to strike us, the acolyte said. I won't strike you. Therefore, if I chose to correctly name you a beast, you will accept it. No. I'll have this man here, I said, jerking my thumb at Rollo. Throw you down onto the deck plate. Then I'll unzip my fly and piss on your head. Barbarian, Divine Griffin hissed. Just so you and I have an understanding on how things will go if you can't smarten up, got it? The old admiral stepped in front of Divine Griffin. We will refrain from insults. We ask the same in return from you. I could have told the tiger the old acolyte had started it, but what would have been the point? I will say no more, I told him. Come, it is time for you to see our loot. We took them down the corridor to the largest chamber in the speedster. There, laid out on tables and under glass, lay the articles taken from the Hall of Honor in Zalambra. The three purple lohars moved woodenly to the tables. They gazed in shocked horror. Divine Griffin hissed, shaking his head, clenching his paws into fists. The Admiral glanced at me. I didn't stare back. This must have been difficult for them. As much as I wanted to destroy Purple Tamika, I needed to make a deal with them more. Ten minutes later, the scholar said, We have seen enough. I opened my mouth to ask him the key question. He must have known what I would say. Surely none of them wanted to hear my voice again. The scholar raised a furry hand. These are from Zalambra, from the Hall of Honor. There is no doubt. This is what I will tell the Emperor. That's all I wanted to hear. In silence, we escorted them to the airlock. They made the trek through the tube back to their waiting shuttle. Afterward, the vessel began its journey across the star system back to the crusading armada. A day went by as the two fleets stared at each other across the star system. What did the Purple Tamika Lohars say to each other? If they attacked, would they attempt to surprise us? Tensions grew on our side. Five Starkian vessels left the globular formation, making a run for the jump gate to Earth. Baba Gobo broadcast to Seer Sant. Sant openly instructed Baron Visconti. One last time, Baba Gobo ordered the fleeing Starkian vessels to return. They did not. T-missiles popped before the running Starkians. Thermonuclear explosions destroyed the shark-shaped ships. The Emperor's crusading armada had just witnessed the event. Had that given them heart to fight it out? Did the Emperor say, forget the old Articles of Honor? Today we will acquire new ones from their corpses. Another three hours passed before the Emperor's comm officer broadcast a message to our fleet. The Emperor wishes to speak on an open line to the human called Commander Creed. I agreed, of course. Then I put on a uniform a dark outfit with silver trim with the forty-four visible on my hip. Sitting in my commander's chair on the quarrel, I readied myself for a talk that would surely go down in interstellar history. He's ready, Ella informed me. Put him on, I said. 
Seconds later, Felix Rex Logos appeared on the hollow image before me. His presence was regal. I knew that every Lohar, Starkian, and human watched the exchange. Commander Creed, the Emperor said, speaking first. I would address you. I'm listening, I said. You have perpetrated a heinous and monstrous deed, he said. You took what did not belong to you. I demand that you return our articles of honor. I'll gladly do this, I said. The moment you return all the billions of humans you ordered to death by your initial attack on Earth. His manner grew heavier, more solemn. You know that I cannot do this. Oh, well, then neither can I. We will fight and destroy you. That's a possibility, I said. Before that happens, though, I will personally obliterate the soul of Purple Tamika, snuffing out your eternal fire. That is too evil an act even for you. I grinned at him. That's where you're wrong. But the choice is yours. Personally, I keep your soul and forego the pleasure of trying to wipe out humanity. You can make this a win-win situation for the two of us. Slowly, he shook his head. You do not understand, Commander Creed. I possess the old knowledge. Purple Tamika knows that humanity is the great plague to life in the universe. I thought that was supposed to be Abaddon. He is long gone, eons ago driven from our space-time continuum. Because of what the assault troopers and orange Tamika warriors did on the portal planet in hyperspace, I said, the Kargs failed to return here. You should be thanking us, not trying to make war. You are the ancient plague, the soldiers of death. You have also named those who must remain unnamed. Do you happen to mean the Sheaf Feng? I asked. The Emperor shuddered. Below me I heard Ella inhale sharply. Vain human, the Emperor said in a hoarse voice. Do you not realize yet? Once, eons ago, enemies of life fashioned humanity. You are a malleable species, easily led into waging war. In the ancient days many spoke of annihilating your species. Others said to let you remain for the fateful day of Abaddon's reappearance. They won the debate and set the surviving humans onto Earth. There your kind has warred savagely against each other, keeping your ancient battle skills alive. Now, for the good of the Jade League, you must die. And the soul of Purple Tamika with it, I said. The Emperor closed his eyes as if in pain. I sat stiffly in my chair. Could Felix be right about humanity? I doubted he just made that crap up. Yet it didn't seem right. There seemed to be something missing from the story. His eyes flashed open. You are the desecrator. You are the ancient plague. You... I'm the one who rode inside Holgatha, I said. What? he asked. Holgatha, I said. I've just given you the name of the ancient Forerunner artifact. If we were the ancient plague, the machines of the first ones would have remembered that. Yet I convinced Holgatha to leave the portal planet and come to Earth. Later, the artifact transferred us to Sanakat. We raided the Purple Lohar world and took many weapons of war. Holgatha returned us to the solar system. Are you saying the ancient machine is in league with the ancient plague? You have named the Altair object, he whispered. No, I've named the Sol object. Felix Rex Logos began to pant, and his eyes glazed over. What went on in his mind? He stiffened suddenly and hissed. I know the name of the Altair object, he declared. I challenge you, Commander Creed. Come with me to speak to Holgatha. We will enter the great machine. The artifact will tell you I am right. Then Holgatha will sentence you to die and obliterate your race. Afterward, Dr. Sant will return the Articles of Honor to me, or he will show every Lohar alive that he is without chivalry. 
then the crusader shall fight the battle we were meant to wage. Do not agree to this, N7 told me. I glanced down at the android. You think he's right about humanity? Shakloth had large plans for your people, N7 said. I believe the Jelk knew more than he told others. Do you have the honor to accept my challenge? the Emperor asked. Our fleets will wait for the outcome of our venture? I asked. I have already agreed to that, the Emperor said. I knew Holgatha had warned me never to come back, but how could I refuse this challenge? Besides, I was curious as to the truth of the Emperor's so-called ancient history. Sure, I said. Why not? Let's go see if we can make the artifact talk to me one more time. Chapter 33 The Emperor of the Lohars clanked beside me. We moved along the inner curve of Holgatha. The artificial black hole in the center of the donut-shaped artifact radiated its harmful rays against us. Felix Rex Logos's shuttle waited on the artifact's outer edge. The Achilles, under Zoe's command, did likewise for me. No other Lohar or human walked on Holgatha. It was just the two of us. The Emperor wore powered armor. I had my heavy vac suit. He towered over me and possessed greater girth and mass. I was Creed the Killer, born from a race of fighters, if one believed the Emperor's tale. Strange how it came down to this, eh? Yet it was fitting. I'd been right to give everyone the artifact's name. It had cemented my authority to these religion-besotted aliens. I found it interesting that the Emperor hadn't rejected my knowledge of the object's name. Could I have played this differently? With a shrug, I continued to trek toward the alien city on the inner edge. Once the Emperor stopped and stared. I checked to see what he looked at. It was the city. Back in the Altair star system, he used to guard Holgatha. Now he had the possibility of going inside. Did it excite old Felix? I imagined so. This must have been a dream come true for him. But he must also fear going in with me. With my thoughts jumping from one topic to the other, I advanced with the Emperor to the low buildings. Soon enough, we stood before the wall. I took a deep breath. Olgatha had warned me never to return, yet here I was. I knew you would come, I heard in my head. It is finally time for the testing. Come, Commander Creed. That had been the last thing I expected. First motioning toward the Emperor, I made sure he looked at me. I couldn't see his eyes, but I saw the chrome color of his visor. Then I pushed through the wall and began to wade through to the other side. I quickly popped through. This time I found myself in a larger room, about the size of a youth league soccer building with a high ceiling. I checked a wrist monitor and found the air was good for breathing. With a twist, I removed my helmet and breathed deeply. Beside me, the Emperor did likewise. After he took off his steel helm, Felix glanced at me. His cat eyes were wide with awe and wonder. Here we are. I said in Lohar. Yes, he said. At last I am in... Holgatha. Greetings, Emperor of the Lohar, Holgatha said. The artifact spoke through a vast vibrating membrane along the far wall. The talking screen showed bronze coloring with little red pyramids tumbling across it. Without another word, both the Emperor and I approached the pulsating screen. I ask that you remove your spacesuits, Holgatha said, with the screen vibrating more rapidly. At once, the Emperor began to unbuckle his power armor suit. He did it so quickly that it seemed as if he'd expected the request. Or was it a command? I began to open the magnetic seals of my suit. What did the Emperor know about the artifact that I didn't? I would bet a great many things. For too long I'd been playing a game where I didn't know all the rules. As per our agreement, neither the Emperor nor I possessed weapons. 
Before making the trek, each of us had undergone a scan by the other side. It is well today that the Emperor of the Lohars and the Commander of the Humans stand within my speaking chamber, Holgatha said. I just run the assault troopers, I said. The newly coined Star Vikings, if you prefer. No, Holgatha said. That is false. You have allowed Diana to assume leadership of the Earth survivors. In essence, however, you are humanity's leader. He just leads Purple to Micah, I said, pointing at the Emperor. Again, you are incorrect, Holgatha said. Until he entered the speaking chamber, Felix Rex Logos was the true Emperor of the Lohars and the de facto Lord of the Jade League. You're saying he isn't any longer? I asked. You are clever, Commander Creed, Holgatha said. You use every opportunity in an attempt to acquire knowledge. Few species possess such a rabid curiosity as yours. Today, though, I will only grant one answer. Okay, I said. I want to know. A moment, Holgatha said. I suspect you do not understand the parameters of the meeting. I will answer one question from the two of you. That means only one of you will leave this chamber alive. What happens to the other? I asked. As I have already implied, Holgatha said. He will be dead, and his faction will lose the argument. What argument? I asked. Since I am about to explain, I will not count that as your single question. Two modes of philosophy are in conflict in the Alpha Centauri system. On the one hand is the dictatorial rule of Emperor Logos. On the other is the chaotic flux of Commander Creed and Dr. Sant. If the Emperor leaves me, his forces will undoubtedly defeat the upstart Sant. If you leave me, Commander Creed, I foresee Sant's elevation to the Lohar throne. Sant will then rule with dictatorial power. I said. That doesn't sound like flux to me. We both know that is wrong, Holgatha said. Ella Timoshenko will know how to address Sant, modifying his behavior to suit humanity. I take it you mean because of our use of the Jelk machine? I said. What machine? The Emperor snarled at me. What did you do to Dr. Sant? Ask Holgatha if you want to know so badly, I told the tiger. The big Lohar scowled, and he began to roll his shoulders in a way that told me he was about to fight. That was odd, because the tiger seemed too old for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Did you purposely set up this meeting? I asked Holgatha. For a time, the tumbling pyramid silently moved across the screen. Finally, the artifact said, I cannot accept that as your question. If you consider it, the answer is obvious. You two have come today to wrestle an old question. We forerunner artifacts have not been able to agree on the correct procedure for the next phase. Thus, in Earth terms, we have decided to flip a coin. I do not understand, the Emperor said. We have decided to spear the fish barrel. Holgatha told him. You would leave your decision to random chance? The Emperor asked the artifact. I have already given you the truth, Holgatha said. Are you so dense that you must ask for a confirmation? I withdraw my question, the Emperor said. You show a modicum of decorum, Holgatha said. In these recent years I have grown unaccustomed to it as I have principally addressed the impulsive Commander Creed. Touché, I said. When are you going to tell us the rules of this little morality play? I am flipping the coin, spearing the fish barrel, Holgatha said. Perhaps the Creator in his hidden wisdom will allow the correct procedure to take place by aiding the one who then goes on to win. You going to stick to the story that you're serving him? I asked. I have not made that claim, Holgatha said. I have said that we artifacts await his appearance. 
With greater vigor than before, the Emperor rolled his shoulders, trying to loosen them, it appeared. I faced the Lohar. Do you know what's going on? We have come to fight, the Emperor declared. Are you kidding me? I asked. You're too old to want to face me in this battle cage. Instead of roaring with rage, Felix Rex Logos showed his fangs. I am not just any Lohar, he said. Yeah? I am the chief of the Shi Feng. So you're going to blow yourself up? You see an old Lohar before you. It is an illusion, human. According to the ancient traditions of the Shi Feng, I have taken body modifications. You have bionic strength? I asked. Together with speeded reflexes and titanium-tipped claws, the Emperor told me. I thought no one was supposed to utter the name Shi Feng. If you hear someone say that, you're supposed to go crazy with rage. Under normal circumstances, that is so, he said. However, I am speaking to the dead. One may say anything he wants to them. I'll say this for the old tiger. The Emperor had confidence. Could I have made a mistake in coming here? The idea troubled me. The Emperor must not have wanted to see Lohar warships destroyed. Felix must have figured this was the easiest way to defeat the rebels. I faced the bronze screen, asking Holgatha, What kind of weapons do we get? None, the artifact said. This is not a battle of technology, but of brawn, bravery, and what you might term as brass balls. I took several steps away from the Emperor, giving me some separation. Old or not, I respected those retractable claws. Seems like I should have an equalizer in lieu of his natural armaments, I said. Lohar meets human, Holgatha said. It is a fitting contest. There will be no equalizers, for none are required. Why do you say that our meeting is fitting? I asked. Is that your singular question? The artifact asked. I withdraw the question, I said. Afterward, I waited for the machine to tell me I had decorum. Holgatha never did. No, the forerunner object said. You must each compose yourself and ask your question. Emperor, as the longer-lived species you will ask first. The Emperor sat down cross-legged. He bent his head, no doubt thinking hard. I walked away from the Lohar and went to a bulkhead. Sitting as well, I leaned against the cool substance. What should I ask the ancient machine? A number of questions tumbled in my mind. I finally settled on what I wanted to know most. Then I really began to think. I had to construct the question in such a way that the machine gave me several answers. Yet, if my key assumption was wrong, I might be throwing away a priceless opportunity. No, I had to ask this the way I planned it. I'm ready, I said. The Emperor looked up but said nothing. After a moment, he studied the floor again. Fifteen minutes passed. Finally, the old Lohar stood up. I am decided, Felix told Holgatha. Ask, the machine said. What is the true purpose of the Forerunner artifacts? The Emperor asked. I stared at the tiger. That was a good question. It showed me the Emperor had his doubts about the ancient machines. Had he begun to feel manipulated by Holgatha as I was feeling? Commander Creed, the artifact said. What is your question? I cleared my throat before saying, Why are Abaddon and his cargs beating the Jelk Corporation? The Emperor studied me, and I wondered if he wanted to change his question. Your queries are lodged, Holgatha said. Now it is time to fight. There are no rules. You will continue the match until one of you ceases to live. Felix Rex Logos roared. As the echoes died, the years seemed to shed from him. 
Had the roar unlocked chemical reactions in his bionically enhanced body? That certainly seemed to be the case. The big tiger crouched. Slowly, titanium-tipped claws eased from his fingertips. His dark eyes glowed with vitality. He took a combat stance. It must have been a Shi Feng move. I figured that must be like Tiger Kung Fu, only 12,000 years old instead of hundreds. I would have liked to have been carrying my 44. A simple draw and fire would have ended this farce. Still, the conflict had started with the Shi Feng attacks against me in Wyoming. Maybe it was good to end it with the Grand Master. Do you think you can beat me, old son? I asked. I've taken out every Shi Feng triad that tried to kill me. I only see you, Emperor. Where's your triad backup? He raised his right hand and lowered it. He raised his left hand and lowered it, and he snapped his head back. I am the living triad, Felix said. With my claws and teeth making three. In me is the essence of Shi Feng. Since you are already dead, you cannot sully the moment with your crudities. Know that I will lead the Lohars to victory over the great enemy. We will survive until the hour of the Creator's reappearance. Thus speak Shi Feng Ultrix. I clenched my fingers into fists, cracking several knuckles. I had to kill a bionic kingpin, a chemically altered superstar trained in the ancient art of Lohar clawed combat. Clearly the Forerunner machines had too much influence in our affairs. If I survived, I planned to change that. Yeah, I'd change a good many things. First, though, I'd have to win this match. Felix Rex Logos had claws and teeth. I had fists and speed. He had reach, size, and maybe even strength. I had my cunning. What had Holgatha said? There were no rules. I nodded sharply, went into my own combat stance, and began to circle the tiger. He watched me. I saw his eyes drinking in everything I did. I had the horrible experience of a master combat artist judging things I didn't even know I did. Ah, the Emperor said. I see what you're attempting. You wish to maneuver me onto the other side of your spacesuit. No doubt you will attempt to use it like a net. I halted, stunned. That's exactly what I'd been planning. How could he have known that? The Emperor chuckled dryly. Truly, Commander Creed, you do not understand what it means to be Shi Feng. I will kill you. And lose your empire and the League to Abaddon, I said. I'm the better strategist between us. Without me, your race is doomed to defeat. I will stamp out the ancient plague of humanity, he said. The others never should have made your kind. Finally, I will right an old wrong. Who are the others? I asked. Felix Rex logo smiled. I wanted to smash the smirk from his face. It is good to see you yearn to know, he told me. How miserable you will feel, Commander, going down to death with all these unanswered questions pulsating in your skull. I gathered saliva in my mouth and spat on the floor. Then I dashed to the spacesuit, grabbing it in one hand and the helmet in the other. The Emperor moved fast, charging me. I flung the helmet like a missile. He swatted it away so the helmet shattered against a wall. He moved fast and delicately, with total economy of motion. I twirled the spacesuit over my head, flinging it low at his shins, hoping to trip him. He leapt so the spinning suit went under him. Without a sound, his padded feet touched down. Then he came at me, swinging those deadly claws at my face. I retreated. He followed, swishing the titanium-tipped claws. For the next fifteen minutes we twirled faster than dancers, employing moves and counter-moves. Once he put three cuts in a row on my left inner forearm so crimson drops fell onto the floor. Another time a slash ripped open my shirt and blood spurted from my chest to splash onto the fur of his left cheek. By then we both panted. He looked winded as he retreated, breathing hard as he tried to wipe away the blood on his face. I just stood there waiting with my heart jackhammering in my chest. After half a minute, the Emperor appeared revived. That was too fast of a recovery, as my heart still thudded. Interior chemical injections, I said. 
He has an unfair advantage. No rules, Holgatha said in his deep mechanical voice. Do not whine, Commander Creed, the Emperor said. Die with whatever dignity you can muster. I gave him the finger. It made me feel better as the bastard had tricked me. We weren't supposed to bring weapons. He had, himself. Chalk one up for the Lohar Emperor. Still giving him the finger, I said, Here's what you can do with your dignity. At your orders, I lost my father, my family, and my planet. You have a lot to answer for, Mr. Emperor, dude bro. He nodded. My office is a heavy burden, I admit it. Yet I carry the weight for the good of my people. Oh yeah, I said. You've done a real bang-up job of it too, haven't you? The Jelt Corporation has been kicking your ass for decades. It will be far better for you to commit suicide like your bomber boys and let a real strategist like me take over. I saved the universe at the portal planet. What did you do? Nothing but try to stop me with your daughter-wife, Princess Nee. She begged to go, he said. She begged to die, you mean? I said. If she'd had her way, the Kargs would be in mass force instead of just engaged in a somewhat even fight against the Jelk. You are making guesses about them. You think? I asked. The Emperor straightened. Making a production out of it, he brought his hands together in front of his face like a kung fu master. For a second, he held himself perfectly still. Then he unfolded his arms and took a new stance, one that looked uncomfortable for such a heavy lohar. Our duel is at an end, he said in a formal way. I am ready to commit the coup de grace. No, Commander Creed, that I will detach your head from your shoulders. I will peel away the skin and keep your skull in our hall of honor. As long as worlds exist, Lohars will speak about this day and my glorious victory inside Holgatha. I watched Felix Rex Logos as he spoke. It occurred to me then that I couldn't survive the fight. He had what was probably the ultimate training, natural armaments, bionic strength, and chemical endurance. The Emperor was right. I was a walking dead man. That meant I had to decide on the manner of my death. It was time to gamble. Did Holgatha need a victor? I didn't know. Yet if I was as good as dead, I might as well grasp at a straw. I would act as if the ancient machine needed one of us. That meant I simply had to outlive Felix Rex Logos. Okay, now I understood what I needed to do. The Emperor attacked, and he moved faster than any feline I'd seen on Earth. Luckily, I was quicker than any human who had lived before the assault troopers. Had Shaw Cloth foreseen this possibility? I doubted it. I charged the Emperor, moving at neurofiber-heightened speed. We closed. His hands flashed, and the titanium-tipped claws shredded the flesh off my chest and gut. It hurt like fire in my belly. At the same time, I delivered a knockout punch against the tiger's jaw. It catapulted his head back, and I heard a crack that might have been bones snapping. Felix Rex Logo slumped unconscious to the gory deck. Blood poured from my ripped belly. Worse, some of my intestines flopped out. Does that sound gross? It most certainly was. I saw rib bones through my sliced chest muscles. With one hand trying to keep the rest of my guts inside my stomach, I stood beside the Emperor. Look, I'm not going to get graphic. Well, not too graphic, anyway. I wore heavy boots and I stomped on his face with all the force I could muster. He struggled. I kept stomping, cracking his skull and breaking teeth. It was ugly and bloodier than you can believe. I became dizzy and disoriented. I'd like to tell you it was quick and clean like a laser to the head. Nope. I'd seldom killed like this, and I never wanted to do it again. I lost my hatred of Felix Rex. In the end, I kept going as long as I could. Finally, I toppled to the deck beside him. I had no idea if I'd won or lost. Everything in me felt numb. The Emperor had as good as killed me. The question was whether I'd taken him with me when I left the land of the living. If Holgatha didn't need either of us, I would never breathe again. Still not knowing, I fell unconscious, so I can't report on what happened next. Chapter 34 What I can tell you is that a lifetime later I woke up on my back. 
I didn't move, just peeled my eyelids open. There wasn't any pain. I took a breath. That didn't hurt either. Finally, I sat up. I was in Holgatha's speaking chamber. The Emperor was gone, and so was his powered armor. The floor was clean. With a start, I yanked up my now uncut shirt. The skin was smooth, without scars. Commander Creed, Holgatha said, the bronze-colored screen vibrating. Did I lose the fight? I asked. No, the artifact said. You are the victor. I outlived the Emperor? That is a needless question. You are here, he is not. You healed me, I said. If that is the concept you wish to use, yes. Climbing to my feet, I noticed my spacesuit in a neat pile. The helmet was on it, and it looked as good as ever. Something or someone had reordered everything in the chamber. On impulse, I lifted a boot, inspecting the sole. It was clean, baby. I lifted the other boot and saw something. With a fingernail, I scraped away a tiny piece of gristle. I had stomped the Emperor of the Lohars to death. It had been real after all. Are you satisfied? Holgatha asked. First flicking the gristle from my fingernail, I regarded the screen. I decided I was done answering the ancient machine. I had a question for you, I said. Yes, Holgatha said. It was a cunning question. In the end, humans are more dangerous than Lohars. It is fitting you won the fight. I refrained from commenting. I no longer trusted the Forerunner artifacts in any way. Your question assumes that Abaddon has reached our space-time continuum, Holgatha said. It also assumes he brought Karg vessels with him and that he is busy defeating the Jelk Corporation. I stood before the pulsating screen waiting for my answer. I wish I had asked the Emperor's question. Abaddon, along with the Kargs he managed to bring through from hyperspace, is defeating the Jelk Corporation because of two factors, Holgatha said. One, Abaddon possesses superior technology. Two, Abaddon is a loftier strategist. I found it interesting that Holgatha didn't say Abaddon had more ships. So Abaddon managed to bring some Kargs through, but not all? I asked. I have answered your question, Holgatha said. I will not give you another. Don't you want to defeat Abaddon? I asked. The Forerunner machine did not respond. You're a frustrating artifact, I said. That means there is balance between us, Commander Creed. The object must have meant that I frustrated it as well. That was good to know. So I can just leave? I asked. Yes. And you think the Emperor's Armada is going to accept that Felix never made it out of you? I have already interfered too much, Holgatha said. The rest is up to you, Commander. As your kind would say, good luck with your future endeavors. I grunted a goodbye. Then I put on my spacesuit and helmet and headed for the exit wall. The trek back to the patrol boat gave me time to think. How should I play this? I mean, in a sense, I had been to the Holy Mountain. That's how the Lohars would see it. I'm not sure what Baba Gobo and his Starkians would think. According to Holgatha, Abaddon and enough Kargs in their warships had made it into our space-time continuum to give the Jelk a go for it. Yet Abaddon had appeared at least 1,000 light-years away from Earth on the other end of the Jelk Corporation. Abaddon was winning the fight. What could I make out of what the Forerunner machine had told me? It would appear that Abaddon did not have access to his billions of starships. That was something. I hated the idea that our sacrifice at the portal planet had been in vain. It would appear as if Abaddon had captured at least one Lohar dreadnought in hyperspace, giving him the limited ability to cross from there to our universe. It seemed as if it had been a one-time occurrence. Otherwise, he could have brought millions of Karg vessels with him. In that case, Abaddon would have already beaten the Jelk and already been here. The bulk of the Saurian fleets along the Jelk Jade League frontier had left to help with the conflict. Even though Abaddon didn't appear to have millions of warships, he had better tech and used a superior strategy. One thing was certain. It would be suicide for the two Lohar fleets to bloody themselves in self-mutilation. I had to bring peace to the warring sides. How could I do that? 
The easiest way would be to lay down the law from on high. If I could make the Lohars believe that I came with words from Holgatha, the Tigers might set aside their differences and join forces in a grand crusade and against the right enemy. Okay, I had my goal. Now I needed a game plan to achieve it. In the end, I went for broke. Returning to the Achilles, I had Zoe patch me through to the Chief Purple Tamika shuttle officer. With my head bowed as if with sorrow and respect, I spoke in a low monotone to her. It turned out she was another of the former Emperor's daughter wives. The Emperor is dead, I said. Yet Holgatha wishes that we honor him as a Lohar of noblest birth and highest honor. Speaking for the Saul object, I decree three days of mourning for Felix Rex Logos. The daughter wife stood stiffly as she regarded me. You think that I will mourn here in your star system? No, I said. Both fleets in the Alpha Centauri system must mourn. We must return at once and tell them the news. You wish to gloat, she said. Slowly I raised my head to glare at her. How dare you sully the honor of Emperor Felix Rex Logos. He was the greatest among us, the Grand Master of the Shi Feng. Do not speak that name. Me? I asked. I am the victor. I saw the passing of the noble Felix Rex Logos. He spoke to me before he died. Do you wish to hear his final words or not? She watched me, and at last she bowed her head. Let us return to the fleets. You can tell the others your words. I will let them decide if you are genuine or not. Yes, I said. Let us begin the days of mourning. Many of those in the fleets mourned for three days, while others cheered and celebrated. Then, at my orders given in the name of Holgatha, the forerunner machine of the first ones, I demanded that all the highest officers of both fleets meet in our chosen battle cruiser. Half of them came from Purple Tamika's armada, half came from ours. The assembled sat in a large hall facing a podium. Admiral Saris of Purple Tamika waited along with Baron Visconti of Orange. Seer Sant came, and so did the ancient Purple Tamika acolyte, Divine Griffin. Baba Gobo came with nine of his chief elders, which included Kaka Ro. Diana and Murad Bey joined the throng. So did several of the late Emperor's daughter wives. We packed the hall with dignitaries, admirals, generals, and high priests. Wearing my black uniform with silver trim and the forty-four holstered at my side, I entered the hall and walked to the podium. Would hidden Shifeng assassins try to kill me? I expected it, ready to fast draw and fire. I faced the heavily Lohar crowd with Starkians and humans sprinkled among them. I am Commander Creed, I said. Many years ago I went to the portal planet and returned inside Holgatha. Later I traveled on Holgatha to raid Sanakat. Because humanity needed warships, the Forerunner artifact agreed to my request. Several days ago now, the Emperor and I went alone into the machine. Today I will tell you what happened. The assembled crowd leaned forward in their chairs. I could see it in their eyes. They yearned to know. For some, it seemed as if it was a religious experience. First, I want to let you know that Abaddon lives. Half the Lohars moaned in dread. The other half looked stricken. He battles the Jelk in their core worlds, which lies on the other side of the corporation. Abaddon did not come through with his billions, but with enough starships to fight the Jelk in endless conflicts. Saurian border fleets departed our frontier long ago, leaving this part of the corporation defenseless. What happened next tells of our arrogance and stupidity. Freed from the pressure of Jelk-led assaults, we warred against one another. We fought for pride of place. Some in the League, like the Ilk, have ignored the old customs and laws going their own way. No, I said. Holgatha and the other Forerunner artifacts are not pleased. Why do you think Emperor Logos died in the Sol object? Was it because of my superiority? I will tell you the truth. He died because in his arrogance he thought to bring brother against brother into war. Unknowingly, the Emperor fought Abaddon's battles for him. No! Alohar shouted, standing to his feet. You lie! I'd been waiting for that. Speed drawing, I aimed and fired a single round. The slug took him in the head, exploding his brains onto those sitting next to him. Lohars roared with outrage. Shi Feng, I said. The rest of the Lohars stood to their feet. Listen to me, I shouted, with smoke trickling from the gun barrel. Listen, you of purple, orange, yellow, green, and crimson Tamika. I just shot a Shi Feng assassin. 
I knew they would attempt this. What you don't know is that Holgatha has told me to tell you to outlaw the ancient house of killers. Their days are over. The old purple Tamika acolyte pointed a trembling finger at me. How did you know he was... She Feng? I asked. Do not say that name, Divine Griffin told me. Of course, Holgatha hadn't said any such thing to me. I'd known because I'd seen the tiger begin the Shi Feng blink. Since Sanakat, I recognized the maneuver. I didn't tell the assembled crowd any of that, though. I know because I have been given knowledge, I said. I saw into his heart and knew him as part of the outlawed assassin band. The Lohars stared at each other in wonder and disbelief. I could see the question in their eyes. Did the human speak the truth? Would you hear the rest of my words? I asked. If so, then sit down. Diana and Murad Bey led the humans in sitting. The Starkians followed their example. Finally, one by one, Lohars began to sit. No, a tiger howled. He lies. We will never disband. I shot him next, another Shi Feng assassin. I suppose anything could have happened then. The meeting could have turned into pandemonium. Instead, I saw new expressions come over the tigers. They saw me in a different light. The Shi Feng were supposed to be invincible. They always killed those they targeted. Yet before everyone, I'd just slain two half-mythical assassins. In that moment, I think most of the tigers believed I was indeed the speaker for the Forerunner object. Something troubled me then. The Shi Feng attacked in triads. There should be another assassin lurking in the crowd. Yet, could Felix Rex Logos have lied to me? He said he was his own triad. These two assassins had been highly ranked Lohars. I wondered if they completed the Emperor's triad. Inspiration struck, but not about the Shi Feng. It's weird how things work like that. In that moment, I knew how to cement the enemy Lohar to me, how to win the diehards to my cause. Because of Holgatha's words, I said, I am formally returning the Articles of Honor to Purple Tamika. Many in the audience stirred, both enemy and friendly Lohars. Clearly my words shocked them. What do you demand as payment? Admiral Saris called out. Clutching both sides of the podium, I stared at her. Not a thing, I said. Nothing? Divine Griffin asked in bewilderment. That's right, I said. Lohars exchanged startled glances with each other. But, Divine Griffin said, this is not the way. Because you have the articles, you should extract grim oaths from us. That is the old way, I said. That way died with the Emperor. I have returned with the new way. In order to defeat Abaddon, we must practice these methods. I paused for effect. Then I leaned toward the crowd, lowering my voice. Let me tell you a truth you might not know. You are Lohars of Honor. Instead of merely having your word, I want your hearts. You will fight the harder because of it. Meaning what? Divine Griffin asked. Meaning that we must wage the greatest crusade of the age, I said. Listen, the Emperor slew billions of humans when he ordered my world attacked and poisoned. Before he died, Felix Rex Logos repented of his heinous act. He asked me to ask you to atone for the deed. How can we atone? The old acolyte asked. By beginning a holy crusade against the Saurian border star systems, I said. First, everyone will help cleanse the earth of poison. Then you must help me free the captured humans among the Jelk Corporation. They will come to Earth to live, incorporated among the free people. For centuries, the Jelk have stolen Earthers. Their children were born into slavery. Together we will free them and train them in the arts of war for the coming Grand Crusade. One against Abaddon and the Kargs? Divine Griffin asked. You have spoken truth, I said. We must all join together to defeat the evil one loose in the Orion arm. Those in the crowded hall thought about that. Finally, Admiral Saris stood to her feet. There was something about her that compelled me to say, Speak, let us hear your words. Who will rule the Empire of the Lohars? You, a human? No, I said. Here's what Holgatha has to say on the matter. Purple Tamika has held the throne for many centuries. Now is the new era of Orange Tamika. They sent their best warriors to the portal planet and saved our space-time continuum. One particular Lohar of great nobility returned from that grueling battle in hyperspace. Do you mean Dr. Sant? 
Ceres asked. Yes, I shouted. You have named the new emperor of the Lohars. Three cheers for the emperor, I said, pumping a fist into the air. Noticing that that didn't get them excited enough, I drew the forty-four and fired slugs into the ceiling. As the smoke cleared from the barrel, one Lohar after another stood to his or her feet. They began to roar and rave with approval. In such a way, Dr. Sant, Seer Sant, became the next Tiger Emperor, ending the Civil War and bringing the Lohars back together. Chapter 35 one year and twenty-one days after Seer Sant became Emperor Sant, the patrol boat Achilles led seven attack cruisers and three giant freighters through the Alpha Centauri AB system. We were returning from an extended raid into the frontier region of the Jelk Corporation. The attack cruisers shepherded the freighters. They held the first human immigrants from formerly guarded Saurian worlds. Several million sons and daughters from kidnapped Earthers were coming home. I stood on the patrol boat's bridge with Zoe Artemis, holding her hand. There's an incoming message for you, sir, the comm officer said. Put Baba Gobo on the main screen, I said. A moment later, the ugly baboon peered at me. Greetings, Commander Creed, the Starkian said. I disengaged my hand from Zoe's and took several steps closer to the screen. Greetings, Baba Gobo, I said. Have your people settled in? The Starkian frowned. It is strange, Commander. We have wandered the Star Lanes for so long that none of us knows what it means to call a system home. The Techs are finally dismantling our factory ships and bringing the machines onto selected asteroids. I already feel differently about Alpha Centauri. I'm glad to hear it, I said. As per my secret bargain with Baba Gobo, I let the Starkian settle star systems one jump from Holgatha. From a distance, they guarded the great artifact. It brought peace to their hearts, a serenity they had long been lacking. On behalf of all Starkians, Baba Gobo had agreed to the Jade League's terms. No Starkian could enter a star system with a forerunner artifact in residence. It would mean death to that Starkian. In return, the baboons became full-fledged members of the League. They also gained a new League title, the First Defenders. From scavengers and pirate contractors, the Starkians had gained honor, respect, and recognition in the main League religion. I'd pushed for that for several reasons. The greatest in my mind was that because of the Starkians, no one could just dash to Earth and strike fledgling humanity. They would have to wade through the first defenders of Holgatha. The artifact still resided in the solar system. It meant the Starkians guarded the various routes to Earth. In time, the close Starkian presence might cause population problems, but that was something the future generations could worry about. For now, I was trying to ensure humanity's survival and then our prosperity. How long until the Grand Fleet launches its main assault against the Corporation? Baba Gobo asked. Another year at least, I said. The Starkians will send warships. I'm counting on it, I said. Good voyaging, Commander, Baba Gobo said. I have duties I must attend to. Of course, I said. Good talking to you, old son. The connection ended and our small flotilla headed for the jump gate. The Jelks still fought a badden, waging desperate war. Emperor Sand had sent scouts to the other end of Corporation territory, to the Core Worlds. They were supposed to assess the situation. So far, none of the Jade League members had attempted to contact the Jelk. None of us trusted them. So we had agreed to let the Jelk absorb Abaddon's hatred while we built up for the Great Contest. That meant the Star Vikings raided Saurian-held worlds. We did so for several reasons. The most important was to gather humans for Old Earth. The second was to grab loot to pay for all the items our planet and people needed. Some argued it weakened the Jelk against Abaddon. I said we had to strike while we could. Humanity had become perilously near extinction. Now I wanted to pump us up and train the new people in the art of being free. That meant learning to run one's own life and learning how to defend what belonged to you. The Achilles led the way through the jump gate. After shaking off the bad effects of jump, the comm officer turned to me. The jump gate guardians are demanding to speak with the captain, she said. 
Put the Commodore on the screen, I said. A moment later, I stared at Dmitri Rostov's Cossack features. My good friend had taken up guardian duties. Commander Creed, Dmitri said. How did it go? A few diehard Saurians refused to surrender, I said. They must be dead then, Dmitri said. That's right. Do you have time to board my flagship? Dmitri asked. Maybe we could play a game of pool before you head to Earth. Not today, I'm afraid. Maybe some other time. When? Dmitri asked. I grinned at him, shrugging. He laughed and saluted. Then his comm officer cut the connection. The last leg of the journey to Earth proved uneventful. Together with Ceres, Holgatha happened to be on the other side of the sun. That was fine with me. I knew now that the Forerunner artifact watched us. The other relics in the Orion arm watched other races. I'd never forgotten Felix's question. What is the true purpose of the Forerunner artifacts? These days I believe that the old Emperor had come to distrust the ancient relics. He wanted to believe they helped us, but who really knew the answer? The artifact said they awaited the Creator's reappearance. Was that just a saying? Maybe it meant until everything ended. Maybe they had their own nefarious game plan. I mean, why else had Holgatha gone to the portal planet? The artifact was the one who had first let Abaddon escape the collapsing universe. The point was I didn't trust the giant machines. I didn't trust the first ones either. What is the true purpose of the Forerunner artifacts? If I could kill Abaddon and free Jennifer and destroy Shaw Cloth while I was at it, I might make the goal of my life to know the purpose of the ancient machines. Today, and for a great many more tomorrows, I had a different task. Soon enough, our flotilla began to break. In the viewing port before me, I saw the beautiful blue-green planet of my birth. Sir, the comm officer said, Council Member Diana would like a word with you. I'd be delighted. She would like to speak to you privately. Nope, I said. Put her up on the main screen. The Amazon Queen appeared. She frowned at me. It seemed like a lifetime ago when I'd first met her on a Jelk freighter parked on Earth. She wore fancy clothes and looked hotter than ever. Alien tech allowed awesome facelifts. Commander Creed, Diana said. I'm sorry to inform you that we aren't ready to receive the new immigrants yet. I didn't want to hear that. What's the problem? I asked. She licked her lips. This is a delicate topic. If I could speak to you alone... No, Diana, tell it to me straight. The scowl put lines in her forehead. Creed, you have never understood politics. You like to point and snap your fingers telling people to do this or do that. I have to persuade others to cajole and prod. I understand politics just fine, I said. Power politics, she said. Arguing with Diana made no sense, so I waited for her to get to the point. She pouted. She tried to outweigh me, and finally she threw up her hands. Why do you have to be so stubborn? If he wasn't, Zoe said, would any of us still be alive? Diana glanced at Zoe and then back at me. Very well, she said. It has to do with placement. Murad Bey demands the immigrants land in Old Turkey. He hasn't ensured full sterilization of the ground yet. He also insists that at least half of the immigrants take his re-education courses. The first group will land near Laramie, Wyoming, I said. It's the cleanest part of the planet. Besides, that's where the new homes and industrial sites are waiting. I know all that, Diana said. Murad Bey is claiming American chauvinism on your part. He could get ugly about this. Murad wants to start up the old problems? I asked. Is he serious? Very serious, Creed, Diana said. Everyone wants to make sure he gets his part of the pie. Murad Bey thinks we're colluding. I closed my eyes and rubbed my forehead. The problems never ended. If it wasn't one thing, it was something else. I'll talk to him, I said. Maybe if I promise to set the third group in his area of Earth, that will help. He has to clean it up first. That will give us another six months before we have to worry about him. Talking to Murad would be a good idea, Diana said. Remember, though, we want Murad Bey on board with us. We want his heart in this. Got it, I said. And Diana? Yes? Thanks for all your hard work. I don't know if I've told you how much I appreciate what you've done. The Amazon Queen smiled. She knew how to look fantastic. That's the right technique to use on Murad Bey. And thank you, Commander. It's good to hear some appreciation. We ended the conversation shortly thereafter.
A half hour later, Luna Command called. Zoe spoke to them and gained clearance for our vessels. At the same time, a lone ship rose from the cratered surface. The craft entered a docking bay in our patrol boat. The vessel's single occupant soon spoke to me alone in my quarters. Looking grave, N-7 sat in a chair. You have the secret report? I asked. I do, Commander, N-7 said. As I said earlier, Sant had sent fast scouts to the Jelk Core worlds. We wanted to know what was happening one thousand light years away. According to N-7, one scout had returned with highly interesting news. The android now told me the message, gained by capturing Saurians and convincing them to speak. The Kargs had indeed come out of hyperspace. During our voyage to the portal planet, they had captured a Lohar dreadnought, as suspected. Somehow the Jelk had learned of this. The Corporation leaders didn't wait, but struck hard and fast once the Kargs appeared in our universe. I suspect Sha Cloth had double-crossed Abaddon. That would be just like the little Rumpelstiltskin. He would have told his brother Jelk the truth, and they'd moved ruthlessly to destroy Abaddon's hyperspace-moving abilities. In any case, the Jelk had lost most of their attacking battle jumpers during that first assault. They also managed to destroy the hyperspace craft, stranding the Kargs on this side. Afterward, Abaddon waged merciless war against the Corporation. So far, the two sides decimated each other. According to the secret report, it would be years before either side conquered the other. The Jelk knew their danger, and Abaddon understood he had to kill the Red Devils before he could consolidate. Our task at present would be to let the Jelk and Kargs fight it out one thousand light years away in the Core Worlds. As they did, we would build up. According to the report, it sounded like we still had time. After shaking N7's hand, I returned to the bridge. From it, I led the way in the Achilles. Low Earth orbit held hundreds of spaceships, with half again as many defensive satellites. With the layers beginning in the other star systems, it would be almost impossible for an alien to do what the original Rhode Island-sized dreadnought had done those many years ago to Earth. I had a nightmare, though. What if the Forerunner artifacts declared war against humanity? Sure, it might never happen. I didn't see any reason why it would. But if it did, how could we defend our planet against transfer technology? I'd raided Sanakat. I knew the power of a transfer. I wanted to make Earth a fortress so no one could do that to us. Take us down, I told Zoe. She instructed the pilot. He began entry procedures. Soon the patrol boat left low orbit and entered the blue atmosphere. I remembered the last time I'd touched down. Winds had howled, tossing the craft this way and that. A lot had changed since Emperor Felix Rex Logos's passing. Nearly one hundred automated factories chugged on Earth, cleaning the planet. Twenty giant scrubbers cruised back and forth in the air, destroying toxins. The winds no longer howled. The purple, red, and other crazy colors no longer made the sky look insane. The old blue had returned. The patrol boat landed in Wyoming, five kilometers from the automated factory where the first Shi Feng assassin had tried to kill me. I'm going to go outside, I said. Let me join you, Commander, Zoe said. I shook my head. I'm going alone. I... I need this. Zoe stared into my eyes, nodding after a moment. Then she pecked me on the lips. I gave her a hug and headed for the hatch. I had goosebumps on my arm as I entered the airlock. I wore a jacket, but no vac suit, no breather, or other protective devices. This would be my first time on the planet breathing the air since Antarctica so long ago. The lock hissed, clanked, and rotated. I opened the outer hatch and stepped onto terra firma. I stood frozen, maybe a little frightened. Don't tell anyone I said that. I have an image to protect. Finally, I jumped out, landing on the dusty soil. All the grass and trees, the bushes and funguses had died to the Lohar Bio-Terminator. We had cedars putting earth plants down. They would need time to root into the soil. Until then, this was a rock world waiting to begin. How many cars had rusted away? How many old buildings were gone? The freeways crisscrossed in places, but there wasn't much else left from the pre-alien visitation era. Yeah, the automated factories chugged over time. The humans and the freighters had debarked near the factories. They built new homes, planted and worked feverishly. They labored to ready our planet to receive millions upon millions of lost sons and daughters. Humanity rebuilt its world, racing to catch up with all the other aliens. 
We'd come a long way since the Earth had died. Now it was the year the Earth was reborn. We had a fantastic challenge to motivate us. That should help to unite us quarreling humans for many, many years. I walked away from the patrol boat, feeling the sunshine on my face. I yearned to walk past waving wheat fields and hear children laughing and dogs barking. That would come. We were rebuilding, and I led humanity in that. In time, I would join the Grand Fleet. We had to slay whoever won the Jelk Karg War. First, I wanted to enjoy my world. I wanted to swim in the waters and see the new sights. Crete! I turned around. Zoe Artemis ran after me. She waved and her hair flowed in the wind. Smiling, I waved back. A pang of guilt reminded me of Jennifer. Somehow, someday, I'd find and free her. What had Abaddon done to Jennifer? Before I could think too much about my greatest failure, Zoe threw herself into my arms. We kissed, we hugged and laughed. Then, hand in hand, we walked on the earth. I think we'd earned a few moments of peace. I planned to enjoy them while I could. Star Viking, Extinction Wars, Book 3. Written by Von Hepner, performed by Christian Rummel. Copyright 2014 by Von Hepner. Audible Studios presents Fortress Earth, Extinction Wars, Book 4. Written by Von Hepner, performed by Christian Rummel. Chapter 1 The spaceport siren blared as I raced past the regular people. Some of my speed was due to steroid 68. The rest came because of the embedded neurofibers in my muscles. Look, a woman whispered. That's Commander Creed. This must be a real emergency. It was real, all right, and baffling. How could anyone have launched a space attack against the solar system without the Starkians and Alpha Centauri first informing us? The other jump gates leading to Earth were guarded by human crewed vessels, so the attack couldn't have originated there. The others would have sent a warning before this. To my mind, the answer was obvious. The bloody baboons were backstabbing us after all we'd done for them. It made me furious. Because I was on Mars with its weak gravity, I made incredible bounds. The hard part was controlling my leap so I didn't crash into the ceiling or against an unsuspecting bystander. Soon, thankfully, I slid to a boarding gate. Two assault troopers with rifles stood guard. The senior man nodded to me. I raced past him into a twisting passageway, soon running up a ramp onto a booster shuttle. For those who were wondering, we no longer called ourselves Star Vikings. I like the term. We pretty much all did, but it no longer fit. We'd graduated from hit-and-grab raiders into a real force. Earth Force, to be exact. In the three years since I'd killed the Purple Tamika Emperor in hand-to-hand -hand combat, a lot had changed. I'm strapped in, I shouted. We're waiting for a few more officers to arrive, sir, the attendant told me. Negative. Sound the alarm. I want upstairs now, as in we should already be in orbit. Yes, sir, the attendant said. She stumbled for the pilot's compartment to give him the news. Seconds later, a klaxon blared. Maybe it would have been wiser to let the other personnel board first, but maybe this was my last chance to get onto a starship as Mars fleet accelerated to meet the invader. I didn't know, and there was no way I was going to miss being part of the welcoming committee. The engines ignited, creating a roaring fireball underneath us. The heavy booster shook violently. I loved it. We began to lift as the roar increased. The G-forces shoved me deep into the cushioned seat as we headed for space. Someone had invaded the solar system. Even now I wasn't sure how close they were to Earth. I knew they were among the inner planets, though. That was the crazy part. There weren't any jump gates among the inner planets, so it didn't make sense that an attack force had made it this far without anyone having spotted them long ago. Did the invader possess a fantastic cloaking device? I should point out a few critical factors as to why I was so anxious. Aliens had visited Earth over a decade ago. They'd called themselves Lohars, although we hadn't known their names or even what they looked like at the time. They'd shown up in a Rhode Island-sized spacecraft, launching thermonuclear missiles at the majority of our cities. London, Moscow, Beijing, and Washington, D.C. had all burned up with a thousand others. A few hours later, drones had appeared, spraying a bioterminator, one intended to kill all life. That had come to be known as the Day. The tiger-like Lohars, of an upright humanoid variety, had been 99% successful against human life. They'd left 1%, however, 
The tough, mean, angry humans with the constitution of cockroaches. The 1% had been hidden in submarines, in Antarctica, the Arctic, and other out-of-the-way places. We'd collectively climbed back up from the brink of extinction. Long story short, Earth thrived once more, reseeded from the children of stolen Earth people throughout the centuries by Jelk slavers. The Jelk had been the source of most of the UFO sightings in the past. Countless Lohar automated factories now gave us the industry we needed for the terraforming and other processes. Since then, I'd made sure our planet had become Fortress Earth. I never wanted to go through another extinction-level assault on humanity again. Maybe that's why I was a little crazy about the invasion right now. Winning last time had been hard. The last sons of bitches of the human race had sold their bodies to the Jelk Corporation, becoming assault troopers for alien masters in an alien war. We'd bought the human race time to lick its wounds. Later, I led a slave revolt, captured a Jelk battle jumper, and began the road that led to our freedom and a place in the Jade League. If that doesn't make sense yet, it will. If you know all about that, hang on for a few seconds longer. We should have had more starships around Earth. Over three quarters of our growing fleet had left for the Grand Armada, the one that was going to head off to do some damage against the worst menace left. I'm talking about Abaddon and his cargs. I was supposed to be with the Grand Armada. Frankly, it was a fluke I was home. Faster, I shouted, managing to raise an arm and slamming a fist against an armrest. I don't know how many G's we were pulling, but I almost tore a muscle with that little stunt. The booster roared into Mars orbit, gaining velocity as it headed for space. The intercom came on. Commander Creed? The pilot said. Yeah? I have bad news, sir. Don't prep me for it, just spit it out. Mars fleet is already accelerating for the enemy, sir. The fleet's velocity is already too much for us to reach them. It looks like we're gonna have to go back down. Chapter 2 I'm coming forward, I said. Sir, our acceleration is too great. You need to remain in your seat. Cut the acceleration until I'm up there. The pilot might have argued with me, but he seemed to think twice about it. A moment later, the harsh acceleration quit. I unbuckled and launched into the weightlessness. A few tugs on the nearby seat sent me sailing toward the hatch. It opened and I floated through. The pilot was a lean fellow in a spotless uniform. The stars glittered through the window in front of him. Do you see those, sir? He asked, pointing out the window. I squinted, seeing a dozen extra bright stars. What about them? Those are the exhausts of Mars fleet. We won't see them much longer. Patch me through to them. He didn't argue. Two minutes later, using a small monitor, I spoke to my old friend Rollo. Officially, he was First Admiral Rollo Anderson of Earth Force. He was my longest-running friend. We had each worked for Black Sand once, a mercenary outfit providing security all over the world. Rollo had been tall and bony back then, and had worked out like a fiend. He'd wanted bulk, but had been cut, instead, like nobody's business. The alien steroid 68 had done a number on him. Rollo was still tall, but there was nothing bony about him anymore. He wore his own specially tailored uniform, a tight-fitting jacket that did nothing to hide the fact that he was a bulked-up steroid monster with a neck and sloping shoulders better suited to a gorilla than a man. He looked more like a bone-breaker for the mob than Earth's highest-ranking fighting admiral. One of the sad things was that Rollo had forgotten to smile somewhere along the way. He'd been engaged to a hottie before the aliens had ever shown up on Earth. She died on the day of first contact. Rollo still had her photo. It was clipped inside a book he kept, one with as accurate a score as he could figure concerning the number of aliens he'd personally killed. There was nothing cold about Rollo's desire to enact vengeance against aliens, any aliens of any size and stripe. It was a fiery desire, barely balanced by a fierce loyalty to the sons of Earth. He'd been the first on many occasions to climb to his feet and charge back into laser fire or plasma blasts to come racing back with an injured assault trooper on his shoulders. In war, there was no one better to have by your side than First Admiral Rollo Anderson. He now scowled on my tiny screen, his buzz cut giving him an old-time U.S. Marine look. I'm coming out to you, old son, I said. That means one of your ships needs to hang back and wait for my booster. He stared at me for three silent seconds. Fine, he said. What? I asked. No argument? He shook his head. What's the situation? I asked. If you want to join the party, you'll have to max out your acceleration immediately. I have an orbital lifter. These things only have so much kick. Rollo stared at me. 
He didn't like excuses on the parade ground. During a system-wide emergency... Ella has given me the computations, he said in a clipped voice. She wants you to max out immediately. Time is critical, Commander. Ella's with you? He barely nodded. That was good news. Ella had been a Russian scientist in Antarctica on the day. What aren't you telling me? I asked. It seemed he fought with himself for a moment, as if he wanted to start smashing things. We hardly know anything yet, he said in a hoarse voice. They're hidden behind a vast sand shield that is moving with hard velocity toward Earth. That sounded weird. Give me a visual, I said. Rollo rerouted what Earth fleet was sending him. I squinted, lowering my head to get a closer look. A vast field of sand headed away from Venus toward Earth. The sand spread out over a tremendous area, greater than the old United States of America. My chest grew cold. A monstrous invasion fleet could be hiding behind that. This was a clever idea, but how had a vast shield of sand gotten there? Our system's jump gates were among the outer planets. How could an enemy have maneuvered the sand wall in secret so they came as if from Venus? That didn't make sense. A terrible thought struck. What if the invasion force hadn't used a jump gate? What if they'd found a new way to travel between star systems? Get ready to send a message to Alpha Centauri, I said. I know what you're thinking, Creed. You want Baba Gobo to bring the Starkian fleet into the solar system. The invaders could badly outnumber us, I said. That means we need reinforcements. The Starkian fleet is closer than anyone else, a mere jump gate away. There's no time to lose in sending the message. Rollo hesitated. Maybe he suspected the Starkians had a hand in the attack. The more likely possibility was that he was considering the political-religious ramifications of such an order. The solar system held the forerunner artifact Holgatha. Once, the Starkians had led a nomadic existence because every race believed they lacked honor. I'd helped them regain their honor, but the Starkians were treaty-bound to stay out of any star system holding a forerunner object. If they broke their treaty agreement, every Jade League race was supposed to help hunt down the oath-breaking Starkians. The Starkians won't come, Rollo said. Baba Gobo owes us everything. He'll come. Besides, he'll realize I'll help him smooth this over later. Rollo shrugged, turning, giving someone my order. By the time he looked at me again, I'd strapped myself into the navigator's chair. The navigator headed for the main compartment to sit. Ready? I asked the natalie dressed pilot. He glanced at his board, finally seeing the blinking green light that indicated everyone else aboard the booster was ready for acceleration. Give it all you have, I told him. The engine soon ignited and we headed for the extra bright dots in the star field. As per my command, Rollo had ordered a starship to wait for us. I had time to kill before I reached the vessel, so I might as well explain the religious political situation that humanity found itself in. The whole thing was weird and rather interesting. Where to start, though? Before the Lohars, the humanoid tigers, hit Earth, there was a grand two-way struggle going on in our neck of the Orion Arm Spiral. On one side was the Jelk Corporation. Nasty, red-skinned, rumple-stilt-skinned devils ran the giant company. The small red bodies were just a fleshy disguise, though. If you shot a Jelk enough times, his body vanished and his true self appeared. That self was an energy creature that could float through walls and fly through space. The Jelk Corporation was hard-headed and tough-minded. They had two-legged lizards called Saurians to do their dirty work. That work included flying their spaceships and providing soldiers for the company armies. Saurians landed on Earth one day after the day. Jelk battle jumpers had chased off the Rhode Island-sized dreadnought that had attacked Earth. None of us knew that at the time. We figured the Saurians had done the mass killing. Thus, being in a murderous rage, I'd killed Saurians in order to get aboard a landing craft. I'd had some big plans that day. But that's not what I'm trying to explain. On the other side of the Grand Orion arm conflict were all the other aliens. The most important were the Lohars, who worshipped the Creator. That's key to understanding the political scheme. The Lohars had created the Holy Jade League. They fought a losing religious war against the Jelk Corporation. The Jade League protected and worshipped at ancient forerunner artifacts. The best way to think of those in Jade League religious terms were as holy Catholic relics. As I've said, Earth now had a forerunner artifact of its own. It was an ancient machine the size of an asteroid. It could talk, think, and do freaking wild things. One of those things was to transfer or teleport to just about anywhere in the blink of an eye. That was ancient forerunner technology for you. 
The forerunners, by the way, were the first ones, really intelligent beings who had made the jump gates and other cool crap. They were so bright and inventive that they were all gone. The going consensus was that they were extinct. The solar system, and Earth in particular, was a backyard dirt pile in the scheme of Orion Arm religious politics. The Jelk had planned to come to Earth to recruit hundreds of millions of slave soldiers for their company armies. The Tigers figured no way could they let us ferocious humans loose on the star lanes, so they tried to exterminate us before we became a problem. Maybe I should be more exact. The Purple Tamika Emperor had reasoned it out like that, giving the kill order to his subjects. That's one of the reasons I killed the bastard three years ago, plain old human revenge. A good tiger by the name of Dr. Sant, belonging to Orange Tamika, now ruled the Lohars. The tigers had become humanity's friends in the bargain. I'm sure that's all as clear as mud as the old expression goes. Well, it gets more interesting. A third party joined the fray. They're the Kargs, ruled by a demonic being named Abaddon. It's a mess of an explanation. Let's just leave it at this. I helped stop the original Karg invasion, one that came from a different space-time continuum. You heard me right. They were from a different reality. They would have come in their trillions and a billion spaceships. We assault troopers took their portal planet away, stranding them in their dying space-time continuum. However, and this is a big one, believe me, Abaddon made it out with enough Kargs and giant moth ships to begin attacking the Jelk Corporation core worlds. That meant the Kargs and Jelk had been battling it out 1,000 light years from Earth. That gave me the needed time to get rid of the Purple Emperor and help put the Orange in his place. It gave humanity time to fix the Earth, repopulate it, and build a tough little fleet of our own. Now, when I say Earth Force was little, that's in comparison to everyone else. We made up for it by being the toughest mofos on the block. That only makes sense, right? The nice humans had all died on the day. The only ones left were the crazy kind, the ones regular people had avoided when everything had been normal. Anyway, after a lot of complications, things had worked out for humanity. We joined the Jade League, and I managed to help the baboon-like Starkians get their honor back. The other races no longer sneered at them as space vagabonds and nomadic trash. The Starkians also sealed Earth's most easily used jump gate. As the booster continued for the waiting ship, I used the monitor. I studied the wall of space sand. It moved away from Venus toward Earth. How long would it take Mars' fleet to reach the wall of sand? Could it do so before the sand and whatever was behind it reached Earth? I ran some calculations and knew momentary relief. The edge of the vast sand wall would barely pass Earth. That was something. At least the grainy particles wouldn't sandblast the planet or its atmosphere away. However, whatever was behind the sand wall would reach Earth in... 27 hours. We only had a little time left. Was that enough time for Mars' fleet to join the battle? Maybe only if whatever enemy ships over there didn't accelerate through the wall of sand to make a dash at our planet. If they did make that dash, though... I hated this. I didn't know enough. How had the sand gotten where it was without anyone spotting it sooner? It seemed clear. The sand hadn't used a jump gate. What motive technology had it used? I had a grim feeling that the sand had used Forerunner technology to teleport into place. It was the only explanation that made sense. That would be bad if true. It might mean that the ancient machines like Holgatha had finally turned against us. Fighting Forerunner tech would be like Stone Age tribesmen trying to defeat tanks with flint-tipped spears. It was something that wasn't going to happen. Did that mean I was rushing to my death? I had no idea. So I waited trying to will the booster to greater acceleration. Instead, the engines quit as weightlessness returned to the rocket. We're out of fuel, the pilot told me. Someone must have screwed up at the spaceport. We should have had a lot more fuel than this. This was just great. Now what was I going to do? Chapter 3 Any change in the situation? I asked. I walked onto the bridge of the George Patton, Rollo's flagship. It was a big starship, built like a jelk battle jumper. It was new from our orbital Earth factories, which put out one new battle jumper a month. The Mars booster was a chemical rocket, very short-ranged. That meant there hadn't been any braking to match the George Patton's velocity. That hadn't been a problem, though. The battle jumper did the matching, a team helping me with my space leap from the booster to the flagship. Now the George Patton accelerated to catch up with the rest of Mars' fleet. 
Gravity dampeners allowed the starship to do that without causing any discomfort to the crew. The various bridge consoles were aimed at each other in a circle. In the very center was a big holographic display, visible from any angle. Rallo moved away from his monitor. We shook hands, the big gorilla trying to crush my fingers as he pumped my arm up and down. I grinned at him, slapping him on the shoulder hard enough to make him take a step to the side. That caused him to release his rock-like grip. Hello, Creed, Ella Timoshenko said. She came to me, a thin Russian with a pretty face and breasts that wouldn't quit. Her dark hair dangled to her cheeks like an erotic elf. Despite her Miss America-like beauty, Ella was an old-fashioned scientist, not like the ones we'd had just before the Earth died. Those had been easily swayed by the latest politically correct fashions. Ella only cared about what you could see and count. She'd never bought any of the forerunner arguments about the creator, either. Like the rest of us, Ella had her dark side and a no-nonsense practicality when it came to saving humanity. She was the best at operating the Jelk mind machine, having put many Lohars under it in the past. The present Lohar Emperor had gone under the machine when he'd simply been Dr. Sant. It was one of the reasons Emperor Sant favored humanity to the degree he did. Ella searched for angles, for reasons and rationality. She had a burning desire to know why a thing was the way it was. If someone told her something that her observations said was BS, she would not hesitate to call the person out no matter their rank. It was easy to forget that about Ella Timoshenko when one looked at her. She hugged me, pressing her breasts against my chest, releasing me after a time to look up into my face. I'm glad you're here, I said. She gave me a curt nod, leading me to her station. I'm thinking the same thing about you, Commander. But I'm curious. Why aren't you with the Grand Armada? An uncomfortable silence fell between us. Rallo cleared his throat, saying quietly, Zoe died. Creed brought a body back to Earth so we could bury her here. Oh, Creed, Ella said. I'm terribly sorry. I wouldn't have asked if I'd known. I looked away as I stuffed my pain in a deep place. I would miss Zoe Artemis dearly. Had been missing her for some time already. Maybe I should have said something sooner. I operated on the theory that if I didn't think about it, my heart wouldn't ache so much. She was inspecting a laser coolant, Rollo told Ella. It blew up at precisely the wrong moment. Some of us suspect sabotage. Ella made compassionate sounds as she patted one of my shoulders. I hardened my resolve. Aliens were trying to steal a march on Earth. We had to stop them. That meant total concentration of effort. That's the past. I said hoarsely. We have a terrible dilemma to solve today, so let's get to it. Ella squeezed my arm. The human contact felt good, but we had no more time for niceties. I took my memory of Zoe, placed it in a drawer in my mind, and closed it so I could concentrate. Afterward, I faced the others, asking, How did a wall of sand the size of a continent appear between Venus and Earth? Anyone have a theory? Rollo asked his bridge crew. No one looked up from their monitors. What does Earth Defense say? I asked. The sand appeared a half hour ago, Ella told me. One moment no one saw anything, the next it was there, heading for Earth. I frowned at her. I'm telling you exactly what I know, she said, sounding defensive. I nodded. We have to break through the sand wall and see what's behind it. Earth Fleet is getting ready to launch T-missiles at it, Rollo informed me. The T in T-missiles stood for teleport. I want to see the situation, I said. Ella manipulated her console. I looked up at the holographic display. Earth defense was composed of layers. At the bottom, on the planetary surface, were giant missile silos and railgun domes. They would attack anything trying to breach the atmosphere. Huge laser satellites orbited Earth. They could reach farther out. Luna, the moon, was a fortress. It had giant railguns, laser beam turrets, and shorter-ranged particle beam emplacements. The original Lohar Dreadnought would have never made it past all those defenses to harm Earth. The planet had even more, though, boasting its own private fleet. Mars Fleet was the general force for the rest of the solar system. Earth Fleet existed just to protect humanity's home. Twenty large starships with forty smaller patrol boats composed the force. Currently, it's headed out to do battle with the Wall of Sand. Rollo's dozen starships, three of them battle jumpers, would add considerable weight once they reached the enemy. We'd come a long way from the ignorant savages we were before the day, and we'd come almost as far since our star-viking desperation. 
These days, if someone wanted to pick a Jade League planet to bust, Earth would be one of the toughest. That was by my design. I'd spent too much time trying to bring humanity back from the brink of extinction to want to do it all over again. Still, if I'd known the Wall of Sand would appear, I would have kept everything back home, having sent nothing to the Grand Armada. One battle jumper, the only one that belonged to Earth Fleet, inched a little farther out than the rest of its sister ships. The battle jumper is about to launch a salvo of T-missiles, Ella explained. Is the starship captain aiming behind the sand or on it? I asked. On, I believe. I've been thinking, Rollo said quietly. Ella and I glanced at him. There's only one way that I know of that something just appears, Rollo said. I kept staring at him. Forerunner transfer technology, he whispered. His words were like a blow to the gut. They actually hurt. That's one of the ways to know if a thing seems reasonable or not. If it hurts, that's probably because there's a grain of truth to it. If you don't care what's said, it's because the thing is not even a remote possibility. That's why most insults that weren't even close to the mark slid off most people. The true insults are the ones that sting the worst. Rollo was confirming my own worst suspicion. Holgatha hasn't moved from Ceres, Ella pointed out. Holgatha was our forerunner artifact, the one staying near the asteroid Ceres in the solar system's asteroid belt. We'd used the artifact a little over three years ago. When humanity had been down to one measly starship, I had convinced the artifact to teleport from one spot in space to another, many hundreds of light years distant. T-missiles only had a several hundred thousand kilometer range, not light years. We had no idea how the ancient machine could make those vast transfers in a moment of time. It was first one technology. If the Forerunner machines were the reason for the Wall of Sand... Would Holgatha have remained near Ceres in order to make us think he had nothing to do with this? Rollo asked. I doubt it, I said. He wouldn't care enough. No. The more I consider this, the more I don't think the Forerunner artifacts are behind the attack. Why not? Ella asked. The machines aren't inclined to direct bloodthirsty action, I said. It's not their way. Look! Rollo shouted. The team missiles are launching! I watched the holographic display. The battle jumper heading toward the wall of sand launched over a dozen big missiles. Those missiles disappeared from view one by one. The first thermonuclear explosion blasted sand from the continental-sized wall. More T-missiles kept appearing at places hundreds or even thousands of kilometers from the first one. They also exploded, hurling more sand from the space wall. It turned out that the wall of sand was less than a centimeter thick. The T-missiles blasted gaping holes in it. The expanding explosions moved even more sand. Some of those forces collided. That also shoved sand, exposing the foe behind the wall. Is that right? Rollo asked in disbelief. Ella checked her monitor. Yes, she said. Along with everyone else, I stared at the holographic display. An asteroid had been behind the sand. It wasn't an enemy fleet, but a very large chunk of rock. How big is it? Rollo asked. A little bigger than our moon, Ella said as she studied her panel. That meant it was much bigger than most asteroids. No wonder the wall of sand had stretched out larger than the old United States. Seeing that makes even less sense, I said. How did a moon-sized rock come to appear between Venus and Earth? What's the moon's trajectory? Rollo asked. Ella ran some numbers. It will miss the Earth just barely. Rollo scratched his head. I don't get it. If it isn't a threat... Look, Ella said. She pointed at the holographic display. Giant blue-colored fumes lengthened behind the enemy moon. That indicated some kind of engine back there propelling the moon. Yet how did one maneuver such mass? It would take extremely vast engines. The moon is changing its trajectory, Ella informed us. It's shifting onto an Earth intercept course. Maybe with its sand shield pierced, the moon's pilot no longer cares if we see what it's doing. Rollo banged a fist against a monitor. The moon moved in a slightly different heading than the pocketed sand wall. My eyes widened as shock struck. Was I seeing this right? Not only did the enemy moon change heading, but now chunks of rock zoomed off its lunar surface. What's going on? Rollo shouted. Observe, Ella said, manipulating her board. She managed to zoom in a little closer. We saw a giant rail system, an accelerator, shooting moon rocks from the object, launching them at Earth. It was like our own mining operation on Luna. 
We had tugs to catch those rocks, as the rocks leaving Luna lacked the velocity of the ones being hurled now. Is that a spaceship instead of a moon? I asked. Ella and Rollo looked at me as if I was crazy. It has exhaust, I said. That means it has motive power. That makes it a ship in space, hence a spaceship. Those are its missiles. Rocks. If it fires enough rocks, it will overwhelm Earth defense. Forget about the rocks, Ella said. If the free moon smashes into the Earth, it will mean the death of everyone on the planet. A cold feeling swept over me. Just how are we supposed to stop something with the mass of Luna from colliding against the Earth? It looked as if after all our hard work over the years that our lovely home was about to die a second time. Chapter 4 are there any suggestions as to how we're supposed to stop a moon-sized spaceship? I asked. It's like a rogue comet, Rollo said. That thing is a lot bigger than any comet, Ella told him. I know that, Rollo said crossly. My point is, how do you stop a rogue comet? You blow it up. Well, that's what we do here. We blow it up. We might not have enough warheads, thermonuclear or antimatter, to do that, Ella said. Maybe, just maybe, we have enough to splinter the moon into pieces. That won't help us, though. The pieces have the same mass as the whole. It's enough to wipe out life for a million years. The thing is too big to think of it as a comet, I said. Correct, Ella said. It's like an asteroid, an errant one. We had plans in the old days to deal with something like that from hitting Earth. Something that big? I asked. Maybe not quite that large, she admitted. But the principle is the same. I'm listening. You nudge it off course, she said. With nukes? I asked. Yes. You have a problem, I said. That's not a big asteroid. That's a vessel. Look at the exhaust tail. That means it has engines. It can steer itself. If you use nukes to nudge it out of its path, the ship will simply steer itself back onto target. We should steer it ourselves, then, Rollo said. I clapped my hands, grinning at him. He'd come up with the answer. Ella shook her head. Creed, you can't be thinking what I think you're thinking. I am, I told her. Rollo glanced from her to me. We go old school, I told him. We've done it before. Do you remember when we grabbed Shaw Cloth's battle jumper out from under him? Shaw Cloth had been our original employer, a red-skinned jelk. During a grim battle, we'd used an enemy T-missile to teleport back onto his battle jumper. It had cost us assault troopers. It had wrecked a lot of the interior starship, too but it had worked after a fashion. How are you going to know where to teleport inside that thing? Rollo asked. We're not going to appear inside it, I said. We appear outside above the surface. I'm sorry, Ella said, but that doesn't help you. The moon has forward momentum. You will appear with your own momentum going exactly the wrong direction toward it. Instead of landing on the surface, you will splat like bugs. Every assault trooper who teleports will die. That makes sense, I said, undaunted. So I'll figure out a different way to land. What way? Ella asked. You're the scientist. Give me a solution. Isn't that what Russian scientists are supposed to do? No, she said. This is an impossible situation. Balls, I said. I already have an idea. We pop behind it instead of in front. Then we accelerate to land on its dark side. Ella blinked several times. Finally, her fingers flew over a computation pad. She ran numbers and velocities. That's out, she finally said. It wasn't a bad idea, but the moonship has too much velocity. Supposing we sent a regular missile with the T-missile, if such a thing is possible. The regular missile won't have enough fuel to accelerate you fast enough to reach the moonship. I tapped my chin, my gray cells alive to the problem. I had the right idea, I was sure of it. Otherwise, I didn't see how we could stop the mobile moon from smashing against the Earth. The Earth fleet ships will have to launch assault troopers onto it, Rollo said. Once they're close enough to the enemy... Tell me this, Ella said in a scathing tone. How are the Earth fleet ships supposed to do this thing? Easy, Rollo said. They break. They're heading at the moon ship, Ella said. To break completely and then accelerate to catch up with a passing vessel? There isn't enough time and room to do all that. The moon ship has too much velocity. This is the perfect attack. That, as much as the rest of the evidence, leads me to suspect the Forerunner machines are behind it. It isn't a perfect attack, I said. We just haven't come up with a solution yet. We'd better do so in the next few hours, Ella said. 
Otherwise, we're not going to have the time to implement your plan of steering the moonship away from Earth, given that it's possible to capture. I glared at the holographic display. Putting my hands behind my back, I began to march around the consoles that circled the display. How could we land assault troopers on the moon-sized object? We couldn't appear in front of it, or the surface would rush up and crush each one of us. It's a matter of having enough fuel, right? I asked. You mean concerning the missiles appearing behind the moon catching up with it? Ella asked. Yes? Yes, she said. If the missiles had more fuel, perhaps they could accelerate fast and hard enough at the moon ship to land on it. Remember, though, first the missiles have to break in order to stop their momentum as they head toward Venus. Once they stop, then they will have to accelerate after the moon ship. Okay, I said. That just means we need more fuel. It would take too many T-missiles teleporting enough regular missiles or fuel pods into position. And how would you get the fuel from one missile or pod to another? We don't have that kind of refueling tech on the missiles themselves. I scowled. We needed more fuel, more mass, more... I snapped my fingers. I think I have it, but it will be risky, really dangerous. In fact, I wouldn't suggest it except for the prize, saving our beloved planet. Well? Ella asked. What's your great idea? I told her, Rollo, and the listening bridge crew. Ella laughed, shaking her head as she did so. I can't believe it, Creed. That's outlandish, insane, and as improbable as hell. You do realize that, yes? I don't care about any of that, I said. Can it be done? Ella Timoshenko stared at me. I have no idea. In fact, I doubt it. But I don't see that we have any other choice. I wish N7 were here. We're going to need incredible timing to pull this off. But if everything works at precisely the right instant, maybe, just maybe, we can pull off this madcap stunt and have a shot at least at saving Russia. Saving Earth, I mean. Chapter 5 Several hours later, the George Patton nosed among masses of free-floating T-missiles. Our battle jumper had finally reached the Mars fleet. The other ships had had to slow down so we could catch up in time. Once we all had the same velocity, those warships had disgorged almost their entire complement of teleporting missiles. Shouldn't we disengage the nuclear warheads first? Ella asked. There's no time for that, I said. It's going to be hard enough sequencing the mass of T-missiles to all teleport at one precise instant of time. Hard? Ella asked. I still say it's impossible. You're going to tear the battle jumper apart with his stunt. Which is one reason I'm going to only ask for volunteers, I said. Creed, you don't have time for that, either. She was right, but it was hard to accept. When they signed up for Mars Fleet, this was one of the adventures they signed up for, Ella said. I don't see any other way to stopping the moonship in time, I said. Me neither, Ella said. It's the only reason I'm agreeing with this madness. But now you've got another problem. The moonship keeps catapulting rocks at Earth. We're going to need the Mars Fleet out there to help knock down all the rocks. That means these ships should start accelerating for Earth again. First things first, I replied. The planet can survive a few rocks. It can't survive a direct moon strike. Ella could see that. How many assault troopers will you have? One thousand, maybe, I said. I'm taking every assault trooper Mars fleet has. One thousand to storm a moon-sized ship? Ella shook her head. That's far too few. You're right. It is. We're going to have to reach the enemy bridge to win. I don't know if you've thought this through, Ella said. Maybe they have auxiliary control stations over there. Maybe they can override the engines. Maybe... Ella, I said, interrupting. She raised her eyebrows. Kindly shut up with your pessimism and start working on the immediate problem. How to board and secure the enemy moonship is my problem. I'll solve it my way, and that isn't by wringing my hands on all the possible ways it can go wrong. No. You like to charge straight ahead and hope for the best. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, I said. That includes a proven combat method. She rolled her eyes but obeyed my command, continuing to link every T-missile so they could make one coordinated launch. Combined as one, the mass of missiles in a precise hole would create a teleporting web, hopefully taking the battle jumper with them. I'm coming with you, Rollo said. Good. I'm going to need someone old school. You can start by calling all the Mars fleet ships. Make sure all their assault troopers are headed here. Do you have your biosuit aboard? Of course, Rollo said. What about yours? I sent it ahead to the booster on Mars before I boarded. 
so it's here. Our bio suits were something else. They had first come to us from our Jelk paymasters. The suits were one of the reasons we'd all been injected with steroid 68 and surgically implanted with neurofibers. Our bio suits were alive, symbiotic second skin. They flowed over our bodies and could harden on the outside while keeping soft on the inside. They absorbed a tremendous amount of damage. The second skin also amplified our already considerable strength. They could also act like spacesuits powered by our sweat. In case you're wondering, the alien second skin didn't cover our faces. We wore helmets instead and heavy combat boots. We first-timers had had our bio suits from the beginning. We'd found more in several Jelk star cities throughout the years, but only had a limited supply. That limited the number of assault troopers humanity possessed. I continued to run the steroid 68 bio-suited assault troopers, leaving day-to-day -day politics to those that loved it. Diana the Amazon Queen and Murad Bey were still alive. Each headed their respective parties for Earth Parliament. We used the old British system of government. Theoretically, I had a boss, the Prime Minister. In reality, I still pretty much did as I saw fit. That would change one of these days, but it wasn't going to change today. The hours fled as space teams maneuvered the T-missiles against the George Patton's outer hull. Welders secured them to the armored skin. During that time, the moon ship catapulted more rocks. Earth fleet charged toward the enemy and Earth Central began launching missiles. Those would intercept and obliterate as many approaching rocks as they could. All the while, comm operators hailed the moon ship. So far, no one had replied. It was maddening not knowing who piloted the moon ship. Who was the enemy? What did they have against us? Was this a new alien menace or an old one finding a new way to attack humanity? Maybe we should talk to Holgatha, Rollo said. I shook my head. I doubted the forerunner object would answer. It usually didn't unless pressed hard enough. Once this was over, though, I planned on having words with the ancient machine. More hours ticked away. It was maddening. I stood on the bridge, staring at the moon ship bearing down on Earth. My gut had begun to churn some time ago. If we didn't get these T-missiles coordinated soon, it wasn't going to matter what we did. It was delicate work sequencing each T-missile to teleport at a precise instant of time. Anything else would tear the battle jumper apart as half teleported away and half remained behind. We still had the other problem. The moon ship came toward the Earth from Venus. We headed inward from Mars. Once we teleported, we'd still be going in the same direction. That meant the battle jumper had to brake to a full stop and accelerate to catch up to the moon vessel. That's the reason I was using the battle jumper. It had the fuel and hard accelerating engines, but only if we went within the next three hours. I called Ella. Sweat bathed her face and worry lines creased her forehead. She was concentrating and didn't have time to talk to me. Two hours and twenty-three minutes later, Ella called me. I'd moved down to the main assault chamber, more a cargo hangar, really. There were assault shuttles and sleds in abundance. We old-timers had used these before. I'd spoken to my assault troopers, a little less than one thousand warm bodies. I had nine hundred and forty-three troopers, to be exact. It was a paltry sum to capture a moon ship, but hey, it's what I had. We're as ready as we're going to be, Ella told me. I inhaled deeply through my nostrils. If I thought too hard about what we were going to do... I want you off the battle jumper, I said. Ella laughed harshly. That's a negative, Commander. I'm coming with you. I even have my bio suit here. Ella! I'm not going to argue with you about it, she said. I'm on the bridge right now. You need someone up here that knows what's going on. Also, this is a science experiment, and I want full credit for what we did. She was ever the scientist. If this works, I said, I'll tell people it was all your idea. She made a face. Ideas are a dime a dozen, Commander. It's executing them that counts. She had a point. How much longer until we're ready to launch? I asked. She checked her board. Give me another ten minutes. I want to run one last test. Then it's go time. Roger that, I said. During those ten minutes, I loaded up the shuttles, twenty vehicles with fifty assault troopers per carrier. We weren't going to use the sleds this time. Most of us carried pulse rifles and shot grenades. We also had a scattering of plasma cannon teams and some anti-air teams to knock down any moon fighters the enemy might launch. The ten minutes passed in a blur of sick anticipation. This was our planet's great hope for survival. How would it happen that after all our hard work to make Earth a fortress, she was relying on one thousand assault troopers? 
If we survived this, I was going to make the attacker pay an unholy price for attempting it. I sat in the pilot's chamber with Rollo. The first admiral was going to do the flying. That was the kind of admiral I admired, one willing to risk everything with his men. Ella appeared on a tiny screen. Are you ready? Yes, I said, over-anxious to get going. She nodded, tapping a panel as numbers flashed in the screen beside her. Rollo began the count at three, two, one, ignition. For a moment, everything went blurry. A feeling of sickness hit my stomach. Had we made it? Disorientation struck. Then everything around me began to shake. Through my helmet, I heard shredding metal sounds and crumpling bulkheads. What had gone wrong? The shaking increased. Our shuttle lifted off the hangar bay deck. I looked over at Rollo. The flight board was dark. Our assault vehicle slammed against another shuttle. That flung me against my straps, forcing air from my chest. Our main blast window shattered as a different shuttle cartwheeled across us to bang against a hangar bay bulkhead. This was a disaster. After all this preparation, the T-missiles must not have worked all at the same instant of time. Finally, we stopped rolling. My muscles ached. That had been worse than any destruction car derby I'd been in as a teenager. Lights flickered in the hangar bay as grim rumbling sounds came from deeper within the battle jumper. The comm came on. At least it still worked. A bloody-faced Ella stared at me. What happened? I asked. Did one of the T-missiles misfire? No, she panted. It was a perfect teleportation. We did everything right in that department. Then how come I've probably lost half my assault troopers before we started the attack? Tears welled in her eyes. We miscalculated our destination, teleporting in front of the moon ship, not behind it like we'd planned. One of the rocks catapulted from the moon smashed through our battle jumper. The ship is shredded, Commander. I swore, feeling sick and helpless. How could this have happened? Did that mean Earth was doomed? A fierce resolve swelled in me. We still had to make this work, but I had no idea how. Ella worked her board as she spoke. It's worse than that, Commander. The battle jumper is getting ready to go critical. You have to leave the ship or die in the coming explosion. We need the battle jumper's acceleration, I said. That was the critical element to my plan. I know. You're going to have to use the shuttles for that now. Right. That's the only thing that made sense. Get down here, I shouted. There's no time for that, Commander. Get down here, Ella. I'm not leaving without you. Sir. Do it, Timoshenko, or I'm coming up there to get you. She stared into my eyes, realizing I was dead serious. I'm on my way, sir, she said, moving out of visual range. Rollo turned to me. Do our shuttles even have enough fuel and speed to accelerate fast enough so the moon ship doesn't obliterate us? No, I said. That's it, then, Rollo said. The moon ship will either smash us or pass us. We failed. Not yet, I said. I have an idea. Chapter 6 A munition explosion tore open the frozen shut hangar bay door. More explosive munitions hammered against an inner lock. The bullets came in a stream from Shuttle 9. It was the least damaged shuttle of the lot. We had begun the mission with 20 shuttles full of assault troopers. Now we had 14. Few of those had a full complement. This was a balls-up. That didn't mean it was over, though. I see stars, Rollo shouted. Ella hunkered in a back seat, having barely made it in time. Shuttle 9 had already lifted from the hangar bay deck. It sped at the ragged opening. The assault shuttle tore pieces of bulkhead as it crashed through, but the operative word was through. More shuttles followed number 9. Get us out of here, I told the first admiral. The muscle-bound gorilla did just that, taking the armored shuttle like an angry baby through its birth canal. We zipped out of the mostly destroyed George Patton. Rollo cursed as he gave the shuttle as much thrust as it could muster. Before us were stars, beautiful stellar lights. I could see Earth in the distance. It wasn't visibly blue-green yet, but it was the biggest thing other than the sun. Uh, let me rephrase that. The moon ship looming behind us was the biggest thing. We could see craters, just as if we had been Apollo astronauts in the good old days. By that, I mean the 60s. If there had been a better time for the Earth, I don't know it. The moon ship loomed massive behind us, and it gained on our tiny shuttles. Our minuscule shuttle fleet tried to outrun doom. The battle jumper no longer had acceleration power. The moon ship gained on it and crashed against the wreckage. 
crumpling what was left of the glorious vessel and spreading it across the rocky surface. No one said anything for several seconds. Ella finally broke the grim silence. I see the catapult rails. Are they firing on us? I asked. I doubt the rails are that precise, she said. But would you look at that? They're launching another batch of rocks at the Earth. I watched from her view screen. A giant bucket sped along the rails, gaining velocity. It reached a ramp like an old-time ski-jumping ramp and shot the rocks into space. They tumbled end over end, heading for Earth. The rocks would miss us by hundreds of kilometers. The battle jumper getting hit by some of them had been the freakiest of bad luck. We don't have much time left, Creed, Rollo said. Maybe you'd better explain your wonderful plan to us. You're doing it, I told him. Rollo shook his helmeted head. I'm not seeing it. We're losing velocity as we break. Not much velocity, he said. Maybe enough so we can survive a crash landing. That's it? he asked. That's your great plan? There you have it in all its glory, I said. How can you be so cheery at a time like this? he complained. Because I'm playing the game, I said. If I keep my wits about me, I may get a chance to win. That will allow me to destroy the bastards who attacked Earth. Uh-oh, Ella said. What's uh-oh? Rollo asked. Those look like hangar bay doors, she said. And they're opening. I tapped a console, bringing up her view. Huge doors opened on the lunar surface. One after another, fighters launched into space. I stared at them in slack-jawed wonder. Those are jelk craft, I said. Rollo glanced at my view. They were narrow fighters with missiles under incredibly stubby wings. Saurian fighters, my friend amended. Saurians, I said, tasting the word. That scratches the idea this is a forerunner plan. It's a Jelk plan, a corporation assault. My hatred for the Jelk Corporation awakened with added intensity. Saurians were two-legged walking lizards, as I've said. The creature's movements were springier than a human's. Usually, Saurians stood four or four and a half feet tall. They called themselves the family and made better workers than they did fighters. I think the Jelk liked them because Saurians were easy keepers and bred like flies. Where did the Jelk get transferring moonships? Ella asked, perplexed. We're going to have to turn to face the fighters, I told Rollo. If I do that, he said, I can't slow our shuttle from crashing against the moonship. We'll smash against the surface harder. Turn around, turn around. I shouted. They're coming on us fast. As I spoke, enemy missiles launched from under those stubby wings. Fortunately for our side, we'd been fighting Saurians for a solid four years. We'd done so as Star Vikings and afterward, as we went after the Jelk Frontier planets. Most of those planets had Saurian guards. We'd gotten pretty good at shooting them down. Even better, we had their tech down pat. That included these missiles. Our electronic countermeasures were more than up to the task. Only three of their missiles hit targets. They shredded a shuttle, knocking us down to thirteen, and opened a huge hole in another. My boys and girls did much better. They didn't rely on missiles, but used auto cannons with great targeting computers. We chopped up those fighters in quick order, leaving hunks of spinning metal and fleshy Saurian pilots to twist in space. As a military problem, their menace lay more in that we hadn't been able to slow our rush toward the moonship during the fight than the actual fighter's basic deadliness. I suppose the dead assault troopers in Shuttle 14 felt otherwise. We know something vital, Ella said. The Saurians have the moonship, but it doesn't appear they have any more technological advantages. Their one advantage seems pretty harrowing, Rollo said. Agreed, I said. I studied the rear viewing screen. The lunar surface was much closer than before. We only had a little time left. We're going to hit too hard, Ella said, studying numbers. That's why we're wearing bio suits, I told her. They'll absorb the shock. The crash might kill the suits, she said. Rollo? I'm sick of running, Creed. I'm sick of Saurians, and I'm sure as hell sick of these jelk bastards. I want to kill them. I want to kill all of them. How about a moon's worth of enemies? I asked. He shot me a glance. You know we're gonna die in a few seconds, don't you? I didn't survive Antarctica to die on this moon, I said. I know what you mean, Rollo said. This is gonna be like the Antarctica lander all over again, huh? No. No? He asked. This time we're going to win. Rollo laughed. It was a good sound. Here it comes, Ella shouted. Goodbye, Creed. Goodbye, Rollo. 
I might have answered, but the moon's surface smashed up against our little shuttle, hitting with too much force. Chapter 7 There's a time for detailing all the pyrotechnics, all the gore, pain, and misery of a situation. Sometimes, though, words simply don't do a moment justice. This was one of those times. The moon collided with our shuttles, one right after the other. Some of the ships crumpled like beer cans in a strong man's hand. Some smashed open like overripe cantaloupes, spilling their precious cargoes over the lunar surface. A few of the shuttles cartwheeled down lunar mountains into a giant crater. That shed some of the initial killing velocity. Ours happened to be one of those vessels. Three other shuttles met a similar fate. Approximately half of the cargoes survived. That meant 100 assault troopers in horribly beat-up shape found the strength to get up and collect what weapons they could find. Rollo, Ella, and I were among them. Every step hurt. So did every breath. Every time my right foot came down, I winced. Fortunately, my symbiotic suit was still alive. It was incredibly rugged. The biosuit began secreting painkillers directly into me. That helped a lot. It also started healing processes. I would need those if I was going to do much. Five minutes later, I'd gathered the hundred survivors. To my surprise, no Saurian fighters strafed us. I vowed to myself they were going to rue this to their dying breath. Listen up, I said, using a shortwave band. We're here. Now I'm going to tell you something critical. A man in the right spot at the right time can do more than a nuclear bomb lit in the wrong star system. Every silver-colored visor was aimed at me. A man with a knife in a foe's bedroom can do more than a million-man army in the wrong city. We're that knife. Us. A mere 100 assault troopers. We're going to have to storm this moonship, killing anyone getting in our way. If we fail, the Earth dies. I'm not letting that happen. What about the rest of you? Many of them shook their helmets. I pointed. That way is the hangar bay door, the one that disgorged the fighters. This is a moonship with negligible gravity. That means we can run fast and far in a short amount of time. The first trick is getting inside this thing. The second is finding the bridge sooner rather than later and then taking over. Any questions? I asked. They were all probably still too sore to ask questions, but that was fine with me. I was tired of talking. All right, I said. Follow me. Someone inside the moonship must have finally gotten smart, or maybe they got scared. Three Saurian fighters zoomed low over the horizon. Each of them launched missiles. Those must have been anti-personnel missiles. I went down onto one knee, raised my pulse rifle, and let instincts take over. One shot, two, three, four, and an explosion told of a direct hit. Other hits told of other assault troopers taking down missiles. Soon after that, three smoking fighters slammed against the lunar surface. It's time to run, I said. They did, following me. As I said a few moments ago, this was a moon-sized vessel. That gave it a similar gravity as Luna. We were all highly trained, veteran killers of many campaigns. If I could have felt pity for our enemy, I might have almost felt it for the Saurians. But they'd already slaughtered far too many of my people. I told myself they hadn't done so because they were good, but lucky. We all like to lie to ourselves sometimes. Brain over brawn, right? What counted in the end was who won, not who fought better whether it was because of bio-suits and killer attitudes or superior tech, like the moonship. Winning determined everything. If you don't believe that, just ask the German soldiers of World War II, or ask General Lee at the end of the American Civil War. I wanted to write the history books on our war, telling my story. That meant I had to win this fight. Otherwise, some hoary saurian in some lizard cave would tell all the listeners how foolish the Earthlings had been to take on the Jelk Corporation moonship. I just had a thought, I said over the shortwave com. What if Cloth is in here? Wouldn't that be something? We can make him float away again, Rollo said, leaping even with me. I'd like to figure out a way to kill him for good, I said. Yeah, Rollo agreed. I saved my breath after that. We traveled up the crater, turned right at the base of the mountains, and noticed the blue-green object in the heavens. Earth had gotten bigger, more visible. It was maybe a quarter as large as Luna seen from Montana at night. How much time did we have left? I was guessing it was not enough. It was at that point we got our first break. Someone in Earth fleet was thinking. They'd sent more T-missiles. 
Those missiles now targeted various open hangar bay doors. With the keen precision I'd come to expect from humans, they threaded those missiles into the various openings. Only once inside the enemy ship did the thermonuclear warheads detonate. The blasts and shock waves would no doubt travel down various corridors. The T-missiles might prove terrific shock grenades, softening up the enemy before we reached them. It took another ten minutes to reach a twisted, smashed hangar bay. It was hot with radiation, but we could take it for a while with our biosuits. Later, we could soak in healing baths. Many of us had done that before. At that point, the assault troopers received a coded pulse, letting us know our boys in Earth Fleet knew what we were doing. They weren't going to send any more T-missiles down to frag us. This is it, I radioed. All our communications crackled with static. We're headed for the center. That's where the Jelk probably built the bridge. This doesn't end for us until we're dead or victorious. I got a ragged cheer and some curses. That was good enough. With bitter determination, remembering all the indignities Cloth had first heaped on us, I jumped into the hot hole, hoping to head down deep into the moonship. Chapter 8 We made it half a kilometer into the ship before the Saurians hit us. They'd set up heavy laser guns, chopping down seven troopers before we knew they were there. I chalked that up to radiation poisoning. I was feeling woozy by then with an upset stomach. Like many of the others, I was taking too long to react to the enemy. Peter is down, a man radioed. Side hatch time, I snapped. My troopers knew what I meant. We retreated from the laser gun nest. Then a team set up a mine against a bulkhead. We ducked around a corner and saw the blast. I led the way through our new hatch until we reached another selected bulkhead and set up another mine. We ducked around a corner, saw the blast, and used the new opening. In short order, we bypassed the blocking Saurians. Normally I would have hit them from behind. They didn't count, though, not in the greater scheme of things. Let them wait for us to show up again. Sure, we set up a few booby traps in case they decided to chase us, but in that case... Behind us, the corridor shivered from heavy explosions. The Saurians had tried to follow us after all. That had been their last mistake. I'm recalibrating my motion sensors, Ella told me. I know their trick now. I didn't bother to ask what she meant. I used my remaining mental energy to keep going. I was having an interior debate with myself. Long ago, our biosuits had secreted a berserker drug into us troopers. We'd short-circuited that feature. With a simple command, however, I could reorder my suit to give me the battle juice. That might make things a whole heck of a lot easier on my aching head. It would also make me stupider. Creed, Rollo said. What is it? I asked in an irritated voice. I found an elevator, Rollo said. He studied an analyzer. That doesn't make sense. I downloaded a schematic, Rollo said. I've been deciphering old Jelk commands and maps. He always had been good at electronic devices. And? I asked. And I found an elevator. Aren't you listening to me? It's to our left. I have to tell you, Creed, it's a long way to the center of the ship. Just like the portal planet, huh? Pretty much, Rollo said. I don't think we're going to make it in time unless we go for broke and use the elevator. Halt, I said. Assault troopers threw themselves onto the floor, panting. We'd been going for some time now. If the rest of them had started like me from the first body-smashing moon crash, they'd felt beat from the get-go. I sidled next to my friend and studied Rollo's schematic. He had a point about the distance. Ah... He'd also located the enemy bridge. It was at almost the exact center of the moon ship. That was a long way down, all right. We had to start turning the massive vessel sooner rather than later if we were going to make it miss the Earth. This is the piece of luck we needed, I said. I think it had more to do with the T-missiles than luck, Rollo said. We've seen the number of dead, right? Those EMPs must have messed with many of their control systems. Had I forgotten to mention the many dead Saurians lying in the upper corridors? I must have been more beat than I realized. Listen up, people, I said. We're heading out. We have to move. This wasn't like the portal planet. I didn't need to kick anyone to get them up onto their feet. Let's double time this, I said. I was getting paranoid about having enough time to turn the moon ship. Did that show I was overconfident about reaching the bridge? Maybe. We found Rollo's elevator several minutes later. Guess what? It worked. The T-missiles hadn't messed with it. The thing was a cargo hauler. That meant there was room for everyone. 
Did I dare take everyone alone? I laughed to myself. Did I dare leave anyone behind? We piled into the box. Ella fiddled with the controls. Soon we plunged down at express speed. It took eight minutes to reach the center. They tried another ambush, big-wig Saurians with lots of braid on their fancy uniforms. They manned plasma cannons, heavy laser guns, and pulse rifles like us. Fifteen assault troopers fell to their savagery. We returned the favor with interest, slaughtering all but three of them. The biggest Saurians, which were the oldest, I took as prisoners. We stormed onto the bridge next, dragging our Saurians with us. It took Ella less than ten minutes to figure out the controls. Soon the giant engines made the bridge thrum with power. Slowly, on a large screen, we watched the Earth. By incremental degrees, we shifted our home planet from the center of the screen to the edge. It looked like we were going to do it. That's when a Saurian horde hit us, trying to retake control of the moon ship. Chapter 9 The Saurians made a mistake, though, an elementary one. They should have sabotaged the engine so we couldn't turn the ship away from Earth. Fortunately, they didn't do that. Instead, the lizards tried to boil through the main hatch onto the bridge. My assault troopers mowed them down. It was carnage, a butcher yard. Pulse bolts tore holes in tough lizard armor and the leathery hides underneath. Awful smelling smoke roiled. Blood spurted. You get the idea. After a while, the lizards tore at the corpses jamming the main hatch. They should have rolled grenades onto the giant bridge. They should have blown bulkheads to make new entrances. They should have at least fired blindly as they charged in. They did none of those things. They rushed us with knives and knuckle crushers. Some of them held their rifles like bats, coming in swinging. That didn't impress us. We killed them like you would kill cockroaches scurrying through the house. All the while, Ella used the primary controls, turning the moonship farther off course. I kept my left arm tight around the biggest Saurian's throat. Surprisingly, he stood a little taller and a lot wider than me. Once I started to get the idea of his critical importance, I pushed the old sod forward, using a pistol. I target practiced against the Saurians trying to get at us. They rushed me madly, straining to reach me, probably wanting to free the old Saurian in my grip, the one I used as a lizard shield. Here's the thing. A Saurian was like any lizard on Earth. As long as he lived, he kept growing. That meant the biggest ones were old ones, the most important Saurians. This old guy was the biggest lizard I'd ever met. As I said, the other Saurians didn't roll grenades onto the bridge or charge while shooting from the hip. Clearly, they didn't want to accidentally kill one of the three old ones we held. Mine was the most important. He had an impressive uniform, too, positively jangling with all the medals on his chest. Maybe you're waiting for me to tell you I got tired of killing Saurians. I'd be lying, though. I didn't get tired. I could have kept doing this for days. My only regret was how sore my trigger finger was getting. I kept switching hands. That helped a bit. Finally, I began to wonder if there was a better way of doing this. It turned out, for us, there wasn't. The Saurians kept charging until more assault troopers landed on the moon ship. They came directly from the Earth fleet, who had finally reached the moon ship. This vessel had literally tons of Saurians as crew and service personnel. Finally, however, the enemy realized the hopelessness of their situation. After a long time trying to kill us, the Saurians began to surrender. We were the last to learn of it down here. Luckily, before our energy packs drained dry, the cavalry rescued us. I could have dropped to the deck and slept right there. Instead, I popped a stim. It took a little longer than normal to take effect. Finally, my eyes bulged and a dry taste developed in my mouth. A wicked energy began to fill me. I hustled my captive into a different chamber. Ella joined me, standing against a bulkhead near the hatch. I shoved the old Saurian onto a chair. Then I took off my helmet. Even here, the air stank, but at least it was breathable. The old Saurian looked at me with big, sad eyes. I'm glad that's over, I told him, using the slave tongue I'd learned in Jelk service. He made an incomprehensible gesture with his three-fingered hand. Who are you? I asked. What's your rank? He said nothing. You're not the wisdom of the family, are you? He sat a little straighter at that. Had that been a surprise for him? I'd captured an old Saurian before on a star city we raided three years ago. That old one had been a robe-wearing priest known as a Wisdom, a religious leader. The Saurians called all other lizards the family, 
although I'd never learned why. Time's up, I said, drawing my pistol, aiming it at his oversized head. Wait, Ella said, stepping forward. I turned to her while keeping the gun rock steady on him. Let me put him under the machine, she said. As I've said before, Ella had a jelk machine, a nasty mind gadget. It did things. I am so callous, he said in his hissing speech. I lowered my gun a fraction as I stared at him. He glanced at Ella before regarding me. I am the Supreme Ship Lord. I received a direct commission from... Don't stop now, I said when he seemed to hesitate. Who gave you the commission? He made an odd expression with his leathery, jowly features. I am not to say, he informed me. I holstered the gun, jerking a thumb at Ella. You heard the lady, right? She's our expert, our mind scrubber. She's going to rip out your every secret. Supreme Shiplord Soko Liss blinked at me in his lizard fashion. The idea didn't seem to trouble him. I wondered what had had him up in arms a few seconds ago. Afterward, she'll reprogram you, I added. That made him agitated, shifting on the chair. Hmm, I said, stroking my chin. We'll give you a totally new personality. A cheerful, helpful one. How does that sound? No, he stuttered. Then it's time you talked, got honest with us. Who gave you your commission? Do you know Shah Cloth? The Saurian asked. I glanced at Ella as my heart rate sped up. That little bastard was behind this? This is important, Creed, she said in a soft, dangerous voice. Nodding, I took hold of myself. I took a deep breath, held it for a long moment, and slowly let it out. I did that a second time for good measure. I hadn't realized how much the name Cloth made me boil. Why had he wanted to wipe out humanity at this late date? It was time to find out. I've heard of Cloth, I said in a conversational tone. Is he well? The lizard blinked at me again, maybe realizing he'd made a mistake. Did Cloth order you to destroy the Earth? I asked. I am on a sacred mission, the Saurian said. I am now forsworn. It is wrong of you to question me as you do. Allow me the dignity to die in battle. I stepped closer to him and I could smell his dry lizard odor. He slid back as if to get away from me, which I found strange for a creature who had just asked to die in battle. I think he saw his death and the wrath blazing in my eyes. The old boy struck me as a hypocrite. This Saurian wanted to die, just not right now, please. Maybe he didn't want to die as I ripped limb from torso. He wanted a quick, clean death, one I most certainly would not give him. Creed? Ella warned. I nodded again without turning to her. Dignity, I said slowly. That's an interesting word. Don't you agree, Supreme Ship Lord? I have sworn an oath, he said. I bet you have. I bet it was a grand occasion, eh? Thousands, maybe millions of Saurians saw the honor Cloth gave you. It must have felt nice. I am the oldest. Oh, wow, I said. That's totally cool. If I'd known that... Now you know, he said. Yes, I do. Would you like a drink of water? I would. My throat is very dry. I need some moisture for my skin as well. In my quarters, you will find a cream. He stopped talking because I lunged at him with a knife, stopping a centimeter from his wobbly throat skin. If you're thirsty, how about I cut you? You can suck your own blood. Would you like that, old guy? He sat straighter, more stiffly, and I thought I saw reproach in his eyes. You are mocking me. Now we're getting somewhere. I am the oldest, he said. I commanded the death ship. Shah Cloth commissioned me. I have been given a great honor. You worked for the corporation once. You should... I slapped him across the face. That shut him up pronto. Guess what, old son? I'm unimpressed by your age. You just tried to exterminate the human race. That makes me angry. That makes me very angry. Do you know what I do to aliens that make me angry? He shook his head. 
I figure out what they hate the most, I said. Then I do that to them. Before I do anything to you, though, I'm going to change the basic set of your personality. I'm beginning to really dislike the one you have. No, he moaned. That is evil. I am the oldest. I hold the old knowledge. I am the Saurian of Saurians. I had the greatest, noblest task of all. Destroying the Earth? Yes, he said, wiping out the nest of race killers. We know. I know. You are the bred ones. You are the terrible slayers. Abaddon has shown Shah Cloth. If the galaxy is to know peace, humanity must die. Abaddon hates the Jelk, I told Soko Lis. The Dark One hates humans even more, the Saurian said. Are you telling me the Jelk and Kargs have made an alliance? It is so, the Saurian said. That was big. It was stunning. The two evil races had made a pact. They had started by trying to wipe out humanity. Why was that so important to them? This is the beginning attack? I asked, wondering about my hypothesis. You would die first, as is fitting, the Saurian said. I shook my head. You blew your shot, old son. You appeared too far away from Earth. You should have teleported closer. The Saurian hung his head. I know, I know. My navigator miscalculated. It was a great sin. I shot him the instant I realized we had appeared in the soul system off course. I should have shot myself then as well. He looked up. Will you spare me a pistol? Oh, of course, I said. I'll give it to you after we're finished here. Thank you, he said, having no idea of my sarcasm. Could we finish quickly then, please? My shame is becoming more than I can bear. Creed, Ella whispered. I cast an irritated glance over my shoulder at her. We'd both taken off our helmets, but we still wore our bio suits. Hers was glistening black like mine. It gave her a decidedly martial but still sexy appearance. I stepped to her as she lowered her voice. There's more going on here, she whispered. Do you mind if I ask him a few questions? Go ahead, I said. Ella stepped up, nodding to him. Soko Lis regarded her uneasily. Abaddon hates us because we stopped him before, Ella said. Surely you and Shah Cloth realize Abaddon is only attacking us out of self-interest. The Saurian cocked his head as if trying to figure out what she was saying. Humans are the greatest fighters, she said. Kargs are anti-life soldiers. For life to win here, everyone needs us. The Saurian glanced at me impatiently as if I would hurry this up for him. Why would Cloth help Abaddon against the Jelk? Ella asked. You are wrong, the Saurian said. Cloth and the Jelk are in alliance with Abaddon. When did this happen? Ella asked. I do not know the exact time and date. The Kargs and Jelk were at war as little as a year ago. That is true. Now they are at peace? That is self-evident, given the Alliance. Surely there are greater targets than Earth, Ella said. I suppose that's true. Why wouldn't the greatest Saurian lead the attack against the greatest object? Why would you be relegated to a lesser task? The destruction of Earth was considered critical, he said proudly. I was given a noble task, a great task. Alas, I failed. My honor is gone. Please, Soko Lis said to me. Give me a pistol so I can cleanse this offense with my blood. What other places were targeted? Ella asked. I was not privy to the planning meetings, the Saurian said. I do not know. Then how could you know there were greater targets than Earth? Ella asked. The old lizard stared at her for a heartbeat, finally saying... Rumors leaked through. Give me an indication of some of the other targets, Ella said. The Lohar homeworld, he said. And? The Sirius system. Any others that you heard about? She asked. Only the proxy system in the Centaur Nebula, he said softly. 
Ellen nodded, still staring at him. Tell me, Supreme Ship Lord, would you really have crashed your vessel against the Earth? Of course not, he said. My ship was too valuable for that. What? I said. But you aimed for the Earth. That was a deception, he said. The rocks would have been enough. Besides, I have a bio-terminator aboard. I would have unleashed it on the planet in passing. Hearing that, I wanted to crush his skull with my bare hands. Did you have another target in the solar system? Ella asked. That made me listen more closely. I hadn't thought of that. Soko Liss swayed. You are tricking me. He gave me a sad-eyed scrutiny. You do not plan to give me a pistol, do you? Not right away, I said. He made a keening sound, hugging himself. It was kind of pathetic. What other target could he have? I asked Ella. She stared at the ancient Saurian. I don't know for sure, she said. But I'm beginning to have an idea. How about cluing me in, I said. Every star system he named is home to a forerunner artifact, she said. I don't know about you, Creed, but I don't think that's a coincidence. Chapter 10 A week later, I approached Ceres in the asteroid belt. I had no intention of landing on the busy asteroid. I was heading for Holgatha, the forerunner artifact. N7 had dashed home, which was good for us and me. The android had been inside the artifact before. The blonde-haired, choir-boy-looking android sat beside me in the speedster. He had begun as my enemy, a D.I. in the Jelk Corporation. N7 had been good at what he did, always winning himself upgrades. When I'd made my break for freedom with a T-missile against cloth, N7 had decided to throw in his lot with ours. He'd won even more upgrades since then and was the brightest among us. Ella stayed with the moon ship, presently parked in a far Mars orbit. She and teams of scientists were crawling everywhere as they studied the incredible vessel. Others fixed what we and the T-missiles had destroyed, capturing the ship. Supreme Ship Lord Sokolis was dead. It hadn't been by our design. I'd wanted to know more, so I'd given Ella permission to put him under the Jelk machine. A mini-bomb went off inside him the first time she tried. Whoever had put the bomb there hadn't wanted anyone prying secrets from him. N7 had informed us of another moon ship attack in the Beltran system. The transfer ship had fainted at the main planet, raining rocks onto the surface. Afterward, it had struck at the Forerunner object. The enemy vessel might have destroyed the ancient machine, but the artifact had transferred as moon rocks sailed toward it. Where it had transferred to, no one yet knew. The pattern is interesting, don't you agree? N7 asked me. Sure, I said. N7 glanced at me. You have a right to be nervous. Holgatha is still processing his subroutines. N7 referred to something we'd learned several years ago. The Forerunner artifacts had certain First One programs. One of the most critical was to find evidence of the Creator. I'd asked Holgatha if he and the others had been trying to set up a universal apocalypse by bringing Abaddon and his cargs into our galaxy, thinking an ongoing apocalypse might cause the Creator to show up. Holgatha had become curious at this, wondering if that could be true. He told me he would internally investigate his subroutines. When I'd asked him how long that would take, the artifact had told me 20 to 25 years. That meant Holgatha was still analyzing his subroutines. His past reactions had shown us he didn't like being disrupted during that time. Still, N7 said, I might point out that every time you've gone to see him, the artifact has been incredibly patient with you. That, too, is interesting. I wonder if I have failed to detect a pattern there. I was nervous, all right. The last time I'd been inside the artifact, I'd fought the Purple Tamika Emperor. The fight had been more touch-and-go than I cared to remember. The end had been ugly, too, with me stomping the Emperor's face with my boot. That had been the ugliest fight of my life. I didn't care to rehash it now. Theoretically, Holgatha was under my care first and humanity second. Long ago, the Starkians had gained their evil reputation because the curious baboons had tried to take apart the artifact in their care. They'd inadvertently destroyed the object. The other Forerunner objects had known right away about that, and they'd known who the culprit was, too. The artifacts told on the Starkians. From that point forward, the rest of the Jade League members had treated the Starkians as outcasts. 
Now that was interesting and ominous on several fronts. First, clearly the artifacts had a way to communicate with each other across hundreds and possibly thousands of light years. They could and did talk among themselves. No one else knew how to do something like that. We had to travel through jump gates by starship to send faster-than-light messages to one another. Secondly, the artifacts had gone so far as to make trouble for an artifact-destroying race such as the Starkians. Thirdly, the reason why the Starkians had destroyed an artifact didn't matter. The destruction was the only thing that counted, not whether it had been an accident or not. Three years ago, Holgatha had agreed to help the Star Vikings. He'd warned me, though. If he was destroyed while helping us, the other Forerunner objects would instantly become our enemies. Like all the aliens I'd met so far, the ancient machines had a very high opinion concerning themselves. Had the First Ones programmed them like that, or had the machines gotten high and mighty over time? Our speedster was getting close to Holgatha. I'd already answered the first picket. Other guard satellites ringed the asteroid-sized object. On a parenthetical note, Baba Gobo had sent a ship into the solar system at my request for help against the moon ship. The Starkian captain had beamed a question to Earth. The reply caused the Starkian ship to turn around and go back to Alpha Centauri. I'd altered the jump gate's log, erasing the fact of the broken treaty. Soon I'd have to go to Alpha Centauri and personally thank Baba Gobo for risking everything for us. It was at that point a light bulb popped into brightness in my mind. I turned to N7. I just thought of something. Maybe you've already thought of it, but let me run it by you just the same. The android nodded. Somehow, Abaddon or the Jelk have gotten hold of several moon-sized ships. That seems obvious, N7 said. Let me finish. They have several of these incredible transfer ships. So far, only Forerunner artifacts have the ability to pop hundreds of light years in a sudden teleportation jump. Instead of massing these special moon ships and hitting one system after another, that's what I would have done with them. You are not Abaddon, N7 said. I gave him a shrewd glance. Do we know this was Abaddon's plan? No, but I would suggest it is. Okay, okay, I said. Before we get to that, here's my point. They sent these transfer ships at star systems holding artifacts. In one, at least, the moon ship fainted at the home planet and then attacked the artifact, causing the artifact to leave for parts unknown. Correct, N7 said. It's a good bet that's what would have happened in the solar system, after they rained rocks on our planet. That seems logical. Therefore, our enemy, Abaddon, or the Jelk Corporation, or both, N7 added, Whoever our enemy is, they want to strip us of Forerunner objects, I said. That is my guess as well. Why does our enemy desire this? I have no idea. Do you? I faced forward, searching for a visual sign of the artifact. I don't know yet, I said. But I know what I'm going to do to find the answer. The Forerunner artifact in our system was as large as an asteroid, as I've been saying. It had a donut shape. In the middle of the donut hole was a black hole. I'd always thought the black hole was critical to the transferability. So far we hadn't found any black hole on the moon ship, nor had we found anything that simulated the actions of a black hole. One thing the black hole on Holgatha did was make it difficult to walk on the inner ring of the artifact because it poured radiation there. The reason that was bad was because box-like squat houses in a small area were situated on the inner ring. No one had any idea who used to live in those homes. They were incredibly old, much older than Soko Liss had been. N7 and I knew the drill. We'd done it several times already in the past. I donned my bio suit, N7 wore combat armor. Letting the speedster float several kilometers from Holgatha, I opened a hatch. Jumping out, I activated a small thruster, holding on to handlebars. N7 had his own thruster. We flew to the artifact, gently landing a little later. Magnetizing the thrusters to the metal hull, we did the same to our boots. Then we began to clank our way across the artifact. The walk took time. Eventually, radiation began to strike our armor. I'd taken the healing bath after the moon strike. Even so, the radiation leaking onto me gave my mouth a metallic taste. I'd never gotten used to that. In time, we reached the unimpressive box buildings. I went to my favorite. This was usually a long process of banging on the metal and trying to convince Holgatha to let us in. This time it was different. I went to knock and my hand sank into the substance. I turned to N7 and motioned him to follow me. 
Afterward, I waded through the substance. It was creepy, but this was the only way to reach Holgatha's comm center. Finally, I oozed out of the wall into a speaking chamber. You may remove your helmet, Holgatha said. He spoke with a wall membrane. It vibrated like a larynx in a throat. The process gave the artifact a deep voice, and it was damn eerie. The light was diffused in here, but I could see easily enough. As I've done before, I detached my helmet, holding it in the crook of my arm. The odor was neutral in here now. It hadn't always been like that. A bench oozed up from the floor. It was a large bench with enough room for N7 and me. Hello, Holgatha, I said after seating myself. Hello, Earthling, he said, the wall vibrating. It has been too short of a time since we spoke last. I found myself holding back. The last time I'd been here, Holgatha had said the winner of our duel would get one question answered. The Purple Tamika Emperor had wanted to know the true purpose of the Forerunner artifacts. That had been a shrewd question. On my most pessimistic days, I wondered if that's why I'd been able to kill the tiger. Had Holgatha secretly aided me so he wouldn't have to answer the tiger's question? I've come to warn you, I said. Please, Commander, let us not go through these tedious games. I have much work to do and only a few years to get it done. My subroutines are extremely complex and sophisticated. I begrudge myself even these small moments talking to you. I can well imagine. No, Holgatha said. I do not believe you can. If you could imagine, you would feel such shame at bothering me that you might ask for a sidearm to commit suicide. I see. You were listening in on our conversation with the Supreme Shiplord. Not only are you bloodthirsty, Holgatha said. I have discovered that you are heartless as well. The Saurian planned to smash the moonship against the Earth. That is false. He already told you that was a trick. His true purpose was to attack me. If that's true, why didn't he appear closer to you? Why did he start near Earth first? That is an interesting question, Holgatha said. I glanced at N7, who sat with his hands on his armored knees, apparently failing to notice the similarities in their speech. Why are they attacking Forerunner objects? I asked. Perhaps to show us how futile the Jade League aliens really are in protecting our kind. We beat off the attack, I said. By that you mean the humans did, I suppose. Many of the others did not beat off the attacks. The human victory was to be expected. You are the little killers in the old tongue. What tongue might that be? I already told you, Commander. The old one. All right, I said. I've heard enough about us being the made ones, the little killers. Our victory seemed far from certain. It was next to impossible, in fact. Did that stop you? Holgatha asked. We didn't have any other alternative. We had to win or perish. But that's not what I'm getting at. The Saurian referred to us as the made ones. Why is that? Why were humans called the little killers in the old tongue? Holgatha remained silent. I stood, beginning to pace. You can't be happy with Abaddon and his cargs. They're anti-life. The Jelk Corporation is an abomination. Everything is profits with them. Yet they're not even material creatures, but energy beings. Why are energy beings so absorbed with profits? Holgatha still said nothing. Scowling, staring at my feet, I told myself to stay calm. If only the Grand Armada had started for the Jelk Core Worlds two years ago. That had been the plan. We were going to swamp the embattled Kargs and Jelk, surprising them. Political divisions, revolutions, quarrels, along with a thousand other minor problems, had delayed the great adventure. It had given the Kargs and Jelk time to come to an agreement. Who suggested the joint operation against the League? I asked. Holgatha did not say. Who was losing the war, the Kargs or Jelk? You can at least tell me that, can't you? Or can't you spy on Abaddon the way you can spy on us? Abaddon has advanced procedures that make direct observation impossible, Holgatha said. Do you think Abaddon wants to replace you? I do not understand your reference, Holgatha said. You're the mysterious power in the Orion arm. Heck, maybe your artifacts litter the entire galaxy. I don't know. Maybe you don't, either. I do know, of course, Holgatha said, but the artifact didn't elaborate. 
Maybe Abaddon wants to be the mysterious force, I said. I was guessing. I knew too little about Abaddon. I didn't even know what species he was. I didn't think he was a Karg. Maybe he was a corrupted first one. Abaddon had power. Every time I'd talk to him via screen, he had given me the shivers. He'd lived for millennia and had offered me a place in his command structure, telling me I'd become an immortal. If any creature could be like the devil in the Bible, only with technological space powers instead of magical abilities, it would have been Abaddon. Sometime in the distant past, others had driven him out of our space-time continuum. Now he was back. I have waited, Polgatha said. But you have failed to tell me how Abaddon wishes to replace us. My head lifted. Why hadn't I noticed this before? I kept myself from grinning. Maybe I had finally understood something critical and could use it to pry real information from humanity's secretive artifact. Chapter 11 I sat down on the bench and began to tap a finger on a knee. Don't you see it? I can predict most actions with a high degree of accuracy, Holgatha said. I cannot read minds, though. What are you thinking? Wait a minute. You can predict most actions, most reactions as well, I guess. That means you should be able to predict my thoughts. You shouldn't need to ask me. Usually this would be the case, Holgatha said. But not today or not with me. Holgatha did not answer. I'm an enigma to you, I said. That's what you're implying, right? No answer came. I smiled, trying to bluff him. Your silence confirms my thought. You are free to think what you want, Holgatha said. I know. I am. I find you to be an exasperating creature. These conversations are nonsensical. I do not know why I permit you to enter my chambers. It is a waste of time. I know why. That is false, Holgatha said. If I do not know, you surely cannot know. You do it because you're trying to understand me. You wonder if I can figure out a few of the mysteries that are baffling you. It's in your self-interest to talk to me. No, these are absurdities. I am not baffled by anything. Oh, sure. I believe that, I said, glancing at N7. The android was frowning at me. I don't think he appreciated my novel approach. I wanted to wink at N7, but I didn't know how Holgatha would take that. I didn't see anything resembling cameras, but I knew the intellect of the Forerunner object watched my every action. I believe I know why Abaddon sent the moon ships against you artifacts, I said. No one has yet established that Abaddon did these things, Holgatha said. All indications show it was a Jelk idea. What indications? I asked. N7 cleared his throat. I suspect the artifact means the Saurian crews. I would guess the other moon ships also had Saurian crews. There were no Karg crews on the various transfer ships. Is that right? I asked Holgatha. Affirmative, the artifact said. Ha! I said, smacking a fist into a palm. It was Abaddon's plan, all right. The Saurian crews are simple misdirection. You and your brothers were meant to see that and draw such an inference as you have. Your reasoning does not hold in the slightest, Holgatha said. Maybe not to you, I said, but I see it clearly. That is emotive speech, nothing more. It means nothing. No, it's clear to me. Abaddon doesn't want you to see it. That's all. Why get uptight about that? What doesn't Abaddon want me to see? The artifact asked. Before I answer that, let me ask you this. What is the critical element regarding the moon ships? You must do your own reasoning, Holgatha said. I am not here to do your thinking for you. I just wanted to see if you realized the key element. It's the transfer power. The moon ships do what, until now, only you Forerunner artifacts did. That's amazing when you think about it. That must mean the moon ships are using First One technology. Doesn't that bother you? Given that it's true, why should it? Holgatha asked. It means Abaddon can use the moon ships to duplicate your most amazing feat. That does not altogether hold. I doubt the Kargs or Jelk have our far scanning tech. The moon ships' improper usage suggests that. 
Olgatha meant that the forerunner objects could look where they were going to transfer before they actually did the transferring. In some fashion, the giant machines could scan hundreds, maybe thousands of light years ahead of them. The moonships hadn't been able to do that, it seemed. Their less than ideal appearance in the solar system suggested that. That each attack was meant to drive away an artifact suggests Abaddon doesn't want your kind around, I said. Maybe he's found other forerunner tech. Before he unleashes it, he wants all the artifacts out of the way. Perhaps his plan is so blasphemous it wouldn't work unless you're elsewhere. Seeing what he's really doing would force your kind to fight him. Maybe you're afraid to do that, though. Your guesses are not even comical, Holgatha said. They are simply absurd. How do you know that? I asked. Commander Creed, I grow weary of your childish ploys. I understand you are attempting to drive me into a garrulous mode, so I will impart to you information you would never receive otherwise. It is the tediousness of speaking to you, the sheer waste of time that has forced me to my newest conclusion. I will grant you your desire in order to end our prolonged conversation. And Seven's head swiveled around sharply. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the android studying me. I'm sure he wondered if that had been my intent the entire time. It hadn't, but when this was over, I'd tell N7 it had been. That would keep him guessing about me. Cloth was instrumental as an intermediary in bringing the Jelk Corporation and Abaddon into their present accord, Holgatha said. Together they will attempt to shatter the Jade League. You have seen the first hammer blow directed against it. The shock of these moonship attacks is even now beginning to take effect. Firstly, many Forerunner artifacts have vanished. Secondly, that has started a religious crisis in many star systems. Thirdly, that crisis will shake Jade League morale. Fourthly, and finally, the Grand Armada will lose flotillas as the various commands return home to secure their homeworlds. The crumbling of United League action will leave the individual species open to separate attacks by the combined Jelk Karg superfleet. You see all this, or you figured it out? I asked. The Superfleet already nears the Jade League. This is fact. The unusual route means that Earth will be one of the earliest targets. What? I would suggest that either Abaddon or the Jelk Council has a special dislike directed toward you humans or against you personally, Commander. The Superfleet has bypassed the Great Armada. If you wish to protect the Solar System, you will need the Jade League Armada. However, it is substantially weaker than the Superfleet. Plus, my analysis of the Jade League religious reaction has a 94% chance of taking place exactly as I've described it. That means the Grand Armada will face a serious reduction in fighting power. I stared at the vibrating wall. If the Superfleet was coming here, did that mean Abaddon or the Jelk had expected the moonship attack to fail? That didn't make sense, did it? Why would they want us to have a moonship? Or was this a precaution on Abaddon's part? Yet, why would he fix it on Earth first? Why not attack the critical Lohar systems first? The Tigers had a vastly greater amount of starships than we did. Okay, I had to put Earth's danger aside for the moment to figure out the rest of this. I cleared my throat. So, you're saying the moonship attacks were primarily directed against the League members to weaken us as a whole? No, not primarily, Holgatha said. That is one of the side benefits to the enemy. The primary benefit is to drive us ancient machines into hiding. I suspect you are correct about Abaddon's ultimate goal in that regard. That surprised me, as I'd been guessing in the dark. I didn't have all the facts, though, and what I didn't know could end up being the most dangerous. If our Grand Armada is weaker than the Super Fleet, I said, I guess that means the enemy has a greater mass of starships. You would be incorrect in believing that, Holgatha said. The Jelk and Kargs fought too long against each other for that to be the case. They should have come to an accord sooner. Why didn't they? That is not germane to our present consideration, Holgatha said. Mass tonnage or simple number of vessels is only part of the equation. They have superior technology, if one does not include the Forerunner artifacts on the League side which I do not for a battle calculation. Why wouldn't you include yourselves? I asked. Aren't you artifacts on our side? We are in almost every consideration, Holgatha said. 
Abaddon's victory would be tragic. His ethics are what you would consider demonic. I do not believe the Creator would approve of him. Is Abaddon a first one? I asked. That is not germane to the situation. The hell it isn't. You will refrain from cursing in my presence, Holgatha said. Otherwise, I will terminate the conversation this instant. Sure, I said. Consider it done. No more cursing. It was several seconds before the wall began to vibrate again. Maybe that was the artifact's cooling off period. As we have spoken just now, Holgatha said, I have run several million war scenarios. The Jade League is annihilated in 83% of them. In 12% of the outcomes, various races will survive as slave subjects for an indeterminate number of years. That doesn't leave us much of a chance. That is correct. There is, in fact, a 5% chance the League will defeat the combined Karg Jelk forces. That would take brilliant leadership on your part and various acts of stupidity on theirs. I do not envision stupidity from Abaddon. Instead, in those outcomes, I envisioned his elimination early on. Wait a minute. You're saying we can't win unless Abaddon dies? That is essentially correct, Holgatha said. And if he dies, that gives us a 5% chance of victory? I asked. Yes. What can we do to increase our odds? Eliminate at least 50% of the Jelk before the main forces engage in hostilities. I stared at the wall. You're implying we hit them before the super fleet engages the Grand Armada. Congratulations, Commander. You have correctly divined the meaning of my words. I'd appreciate it if you turned off your sarcasm program, I said. It's becoming irritating. There was no sarcasm intended, Holgatha said. I didn't believe that, but I let it go. Instead, I cracked my knuckles, thinking. For us to do something like that, we'd have to make transfer attacks. I don't see how else we could do it. Are you willing to host a number of assault troopers? I engaged in direct military maneuvers once before when you were Star Vikings, Holgatha said, interrupting me. I will never do that again. I find my actions back then repulsive. War is a hideous experience, much better observed several star systems in the distance than in proximity. That just leaves the moon ship. It's sluggish. Maybe it can transfer to the super fleet. I looked up. Are you suggesting we simply appear in the middle of their super fleet, locate Abaddon, and kill him? We were speaking about the Jelk, Holgatha said. In either case, however, that is a rough outline of the correct operational plan with the highest probability of Jade League success. That's no plan, I said. It's a suicide mission. And yet I have noted that you excel in exactly those kinds of missions. I studied the wall, wondering about the artifact's intellect. What are the present superfleet coordinates? Holgatha did not speak. If you're not going to tell me, I said, how are we supposed to do this? That is not my concern. That doesn't make sense. You said Abaddon was odious. I said he is an abomination. I have come to believe his destruction is critical. We will not directly help you in this, though, as our programming forbids it. However, I have been engaged in a careful study of my restrictions for the last thousand years. I am about to make a momentous decision. The appearance of the moonship has given me the liberty to introduce the obliteration protocols. What are those? I can only tell you that they are among my oldest programs. Let me begin by saying that you do not possess the weaponry to kill Abaddon. Do not believe that stranding him in space will kill his body, or that placing him in the center of a thermonuclear detonation will obliterate him. What about in the heart of an antimatter explosion? I asked. Abaddon has resources beyond your understanding. In fact, most of this is beyond your understanding. The Jelk, Kargs, and Abaddon, all of them are incredibly ancient. The moonship predates my construction. That is why it is so inferior. It was the first transfer vessel. We artifacts are a vast improvement upon it. Okay. The weapon you need is at Sagittarius A-Star. That was pronounced Sagittarius A-Star. Where? I asked. N7 spoke up. That is at the Galactic Center, Commander. 
It is, in fact, a supermassive black hole. Just like a baden space-time continuum, I said. What are you trying to pull, Holgatha? The android is incorrect, Holgatha said. Sagittarius A-star is not the galactic center. It is the center of your galaxy. That is approximately 27,000 light-years from here. But Sagittarius A-star is still a supermassive black hole, right? I asked. The Fortress of Light orbits the supermassive black hole, Holgatha said. At least the last time I checked, it did. How long ago was that? That is not germane to the situation. I felt my blood pressure rising, but refrained from cursing. In a tight voice, I said, This sounds like a goose chase. Twenty-seven thousand light years away? Is that right? That is correct, Holgatha said. The weapon is in a vault inside the Fortress of Light. What is this fortress exactly? I asked. One thing at a time, Commander, Holgatha said. Twenty-seven thousand light years is too far for your moonship to transfer in one bound. It will take several teleportations. Once you arrive there, the key I give you will allow you entrance into the Fortress of Light. There, the key will lead you to a weapon with the power to slay Abaddon. Return with it, and humanity along with the Jade League will gain a chance of surviving the coming war. I plopped down onto the bench. You want us to teleport to the center of the galaxy while the super fleet heads to Earth? That is my best recommendation toward your ultimate victory. Well, first, I said, can you send a message for me? Of what nature? Holgatha asked. Telling the Admiral of the Grand Armada to start heading to the solar system, I said. Holgatha was silent for a time. Finally, he said, Yes, I am willing. Great, I said. Now explain the Fortress of Light to me. The key can do that. This is a forerunner key? I asked. In truth, no, Holgatha said. The key belongs to the Fortress of Light. It will agree to do these two acts for you as the price for its freedom. What? I asked, rubbing my forehead. This is beginning to sound weird. That is due to Abaddon and the Jelk, Holgatha said. Like me, they are special entities. That calls for special weaponry. Why else do you think the Jade League has been losing this long conflict since the beginning? It dawned on me that I might be touching upon the true purpose of the Forerunner objects. A captive key to the Fortress of Light in the center of our galaxy? That sounded strange, all right, and interesting. What was Abaddon? Why do we need a special weapon to kill him, one found in something called the Fortress of Light? I looked up. Since I wish to forestall another round of tedious conversation, Holgatha said, I am about to give you the key. Your time is strictly limited, Commander. The Superfleet is approaching fast, and I'm sure Abaddon has other surprises in store for you. This is the Great Showdown. The Dark One has made a miscalculation, however. I am sure he did not foresee my cunning with the obliteration protocol. Now it is up to you. I stood up. What does the key look like and when do I get it? It is on its way to your speedster. Since it cannot withstand the black hole radiation, I have let it out a different port. There's another way in to see you? I said. None of that will ever matter to you, Holgatha said. Goodbye, Commander. I bid you a blessing in the Creator's name. You have the weight of the galaxy riding on your shoulders. If you fail, your race, along with the Forerunner machines, are most certainly doomed. Chapter 12 The next few weeks were a blur of activity. It's hard to remember what happened in exact order. I imagine that's how the workmen at Pearl Harbor felt after the Battle of the Coral Sea against the Imperial Japanese Navy in World War II. After the treacherous Battle of Pearl Harbor, where the Japanese sucker-punched the U.S., the American Navy had to make do against the stronger Japanese fleet, at least stronger in the Pacific at the time. Some of the remaining U.S. carriers met the Japanese in the confused Battle of the Coral Sea. The Japanese sank the Lexington and damaged the Yorktown, as well as sinking some other non-carrier American vessels. The U.S. had struck back, sinking a Japanese flat top. In any case, Yorktown limped back to Pearl Harbor. 
U.S. naval intelligence knew the Japanese were planning another attack, the coming attack on Midway. Admiral Nimitz of the Pacific Fleet had two good carriers left, the Enterprise and Hornet. Besides that, he had seven heavy cruisers and the damaged Yorktown to face the coming might of the Imperial Navy. The Battle of Midway would be one of the most decisive in World War II. The Americans went into it as underdogs, utterly turning the tables on the Japanese. One of the keys to that victory had been the carrier Yorktown. When it steamed into port, the authorities estimated it would take 90 days to repair the internal and leaking damage. 1,400 yard workmen toiled around the clock for two days, and then the desperately needed carrier was ready for war. One reason everyone had worked so hard was that Admiral Nimitz had realized navies had entered a new era of flat tops and air wings. The battleships, cruisers, and destroyers counted for far less in terms of sea superiority than the new carriers. I suppose the same might be true for us. With the moon ships, Abaddon and his allies had introduced a new type of spaceship. A regular fleet would take weeks, possibly even months, to get to a location, one a transfer ship could reach in three seconds. That got me to thinking. How many moon ships did Abaddon have? It must be a strictly limited supply. Had our captured moon ship struck here first, or had it hit elsewhere before we captured it? That seemed like a critical question. The fact that Abaddon hadn't loaded up the superfleet on his moon ships and simply transferred here showed he must have one or two at most left. Otherwise, he could carry his entire fleet on the surface of the moon ships. Either that or there was some other factor I didn't understand yet. We have to multiply our fighting power, I told the others. Catapulting a few rocks doesn't cut it. Loosening a handful of fighters was a mistake on their part. The way I see it, we should land the Earth and Mars fleets on the moon ship. We'll take everything with us wherever we go. No, 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 Diana said. That would leave Earth defenseless. She was as striking as ever, if a little older. The Amazon queen with her glorious figure and stunning features had taken full advantage of the alien tech we'd come across these past years. She'd used it to enhance her already overpowering beauty. Diana ran the survival party. Her chief opponent was Murad Bey, the leader of the Holy Compact Party. Diana was prime minister while Murad Bey led the opposition. Today, inside the cabinet room, Murad Bey's representative smoked a huge cigar. He was a squat, tough-looking bald man with a dark complexion, a former worker on a Saurian world who had taken to Islam with gusto. Murad Bey had refused to come to the cabinet meeting, sending Abu Hawkblood instead. Tell him, Hawkblood, Diana said. The squat man, smoking his cigar, stared at me. I'm unsure about this, he said in a hoarse voice. Isn't there an old earth saying regarding the situation? One of the things I noticed about the human immigrants from the Saurian worlds had been their intense desire to become earthlings. Abu Hawkblood had it bad. He was a strict Muslim who read history every chance he had. Sure there is, I told him. The best defense is a good offense. He smoked it over, finally slapping the table. There. That is what I think. Diana shook her head. That's because the earth isn't precious to you like it is to me. It isn't thick in your blood. Hawkblood scowled. I love the earth dearly. It is my new home. My only home. Diana laughed at him scoffingly. Hawkblood puffed harder, sending up a smelly cloud of smoke. Maybe the Prime Minister has a point, Commander. We need the fleets at home to protect Earth. Come off it, Hawkblood, I said. She's playing you. She knows your weak point. I am not weak, he said. That's not what I meant. Is that true, Commander? Diana asked archly. Don't you think of all of us as weak? We're not bulging with muscles like you. You are bulging, though, I said, glancing at her bosom. That's not very chivalrous, Diana said. It's yet another example of your disdain for the rest of us. We're supposed to leap to whatever you say. Well, you know what, Commander? I've had enough of that. Either the people's vote counts for something or it doesn't. Votes must count. Hawkblood said. It is the Earth way. This isn't about votes, I said, feeling my temper slipping. Had Diana gotten better at these kinds of conversations, or had I lost my grip? You want to take everything we've worked so hard to build, she said. Then... Hold it, I said, standing up. Diana glanced at Abu Hawkblood as if to say, look at him, ordering us around again. I sighed. Diana, I'm not a parliamentarian. I don't have your skill at public speaking, nor am I a politician. 
I'm a soldier, an assault trooper. Fighting is my game. I understand battle strategy. Abaddon is coming fast, and we only have a little time left. He has a super fleet. Holgatha has predicted complete victory for the enemy unless I can kill the unkillable alien. The only way... Creed, Creed, Diana said. Spare us your ringing rhetoric. It won't work on us. This time... Stop, I said. I'll meet you halfway. Keep the Earth fleet. I'll take the Mars fleet. No, she said. We need it all. What if another moon ship appears? What happens if ten moon ships appear in the solar system? They won't, Diana said. You don't know that. Come off it, Creed. You must have figured it out already. If Abaddon had a horde of moon ships, he could have landed his super fleet on them and transferred here. Surely the enemy only has a few of them. Yet Abaddon could do what you're doing and load one up with battle jumpers. We need every ship we have for a fighting chance at defense. The truth is, even with the Earth and Mars fleets, we have too little to protect our home world. I lost my temper. Instead of shouting, I gathered my folder and headed for the door. What is this? she asked. You're walking out on me? I regarded her while counting to ten. I don't have time for this, Diana. Political maneuvering is a pastime with you. To me, our situation is life and death. You don't seem to realize just what's at stake. That's not true or fair, she said. I just don't see it your way. How about you try to see our point of view? It's wrong, I said. Well, you know what? That's why we vote. This isn't a dictatorship. You have a plan. I have one, too. Each side builds warships as fast and as hard as we can. Then our giant fleets crash against their giant fleets. Maybe we outfight them. Maybe we lose. What we don't do is strip our world of everything after having just survived because we had fleets in place against the attacking moonship. Our fleets gave us the moonship. That's another thing, Diana said. I claim the moonship is under parliamentary control. Our military... She fell silent, staring at my forty-four magnum, which I'd drawn. Is this a military coup, Creed? Are you taking over? What's really going on here? I asked. I can see your point about wanting the Earth and Mars fleets here. Yeah, your plan made me mad at first, but I'm seeing it now. You can't be serious about wanting the moon ship, though. We lose if I don't use it. Diana stared at her hands, which were intertwined on the table. The world is terrified, Creed. They know we all almost died. If the fleets go, there are going to be riots all over the place. You're not answering the question about the moon ship. You've lost touch, Diana said. You've been so busy with your wars, with your steroids and biosuits, that you've lost your humanity. I'm going to ask you one more time, I said. You will drop your gun, Commander. Keeping the forty-four aimed at Diana, I peered over my shoulder. Abu Hawkblood aimed a stubby little palm gun at me. It wasn't of Earth make. I glanced into his eyes, which were hard and glittering with intensity. You're not human, I said. I am, Hawkblood said. But that's neither here nor there. You are my prisoner, Commander. If you don't put down your weapon... I moved, swiveling toward him. Hawkblood beamed a milky substance from his weapon. I'd already hurled myself to the side, though. The milky substance grazed my arm, burning fabric. At the same time, I brought up the forty-four. Three times, I pulled the trigger. Each time, nothing happened. Drop it, Hawkblood said, grinning at me. The tricky devil must have something in place to retard gunpowder reactions. So I dropped my gun, kicking it as I charged. The forty-four sailed at him. He beamed it, realizing his mistake, and tried to retarget me. He should have shot me when he had the chance. Before he could fix his mistake, I drew my bowie knife and stabbed it through his chest, lifting him off the floor. Hawkblood groaned. He tried one last time to bring his palm gun around. I slapped it out of his hand. Then I flung him off my blade onto the floor. The man coughed, staring at me. You moved so fast. I didn't realize. I didn't. I crouched beside him, wiping his blood on his clothes. That made him grin. After that, he shuddered, his entire body moving in one long spasm. Then he stopped breathing as he was dead. I stood up wearily and glanced at Diana. She sat almost frozen in her spot at the head of the table. The others in the room sat rigidly as well. I went to her. Only her eyes moved, watching me. I began moving her thick hair, 
searching her scalp until I found a tiny device there. My heart thudded. Was the thing embedded into her brain? That would be awful. I tugged. It came free, exposing a needle-thin sliver several millimeters long. Diana gasped, collapsing onto the table. Then it was her turn to shudder. I stayed with her the next several hours and called down several shuttles full of assault troopers, too. It was a good thing I did. Maybe you've already guessed it. We'd unknowingly rescued jelk-trained sleeper humans from the Corporation Frontier Planets. Hawkblood had been among the most successful of the sleeper agents. The next week was mayhem on Earth. Despite everything, I took time to help hunt down jelk-trained ringleaders. A short, very brutal civil war followed. A little shy of a million people died. Most of those came from a nuclear bomb detonating in New London. Murat Bey was dead. It died a month ago, according to the study of his exhumed corpse. Hawkblood had been running the Holy Compact Party for several weeks already. He'd put quite a few of his operatives in places of power. That made it easier finding them now. After the brutal week, it was over. I spoke with Diana in her hospital bed in Brinktown. It was in old Canada where Moose Jaw used to be. Creed, they came so close, she said. The joke are cunning. We should have been more careful with those we rescued. It's just... I know, she said, patting my hand. Poor Murad Bey. He had his faults, but he loved Earth. He loved humanity. He'll be avenged, I said. By the way, I agree with your idea. Take the Earth and Mars fleets. We'll keep building battle jumpers. I shook my head. I'm not leaving Earth defenseless. The Civil War showed me how precious our planet is. I'm giving you everything but for a few fighters. It's not easy to say, but you were right and I was wrong. Creed, she said, staring up at me. There's more, I told her. I spoke with Baba Gobo. He told me he's never sending another Starkian ship here again. I stopped him before he could say more. I won't bore you with the whole talk. I convinced him this is the end. If we win, but Abaddon chases off all the Forerunner artifacts... The Starkians will enter the solar system to help defend us? She asked. In a few days, I said. What about the Accord? Diana whispered. If I kill Abaddon, I can protect the Starkians and give them full rights. I have a feeling I'll have something over the artifacts as well. If I fail to kill Abaddon, none of this is going to matter anyway. But... Baba Gobo saw the logic of that. The Forerunner artifacts seem to be the critical feature. Why else did Abaddon use the moon ships against them? That being so, we must protect the artifacts at all costs. That means the entire Starkian fleet is coming. If Abaddon sends a moon ship loaded up with starships, Earth will have a fighting chance. What if Abaddon hits the Starkian planets? I shook my head. The Forerunner artifacts are the thing, Diana. You're going to need warships with you. Maybe, but I doubt it. Besides, I'll have the entire moon ship, and I should be able to teleport out of danger if I need to. What about a good offense being the best defense? Diana asked. That's a saying, Prime Minister. It doesn't make it wholly writ. Her eyelids finally grew heavy. I'm going to sleep, Creed. We can talk later. No, I said. We're leaving. It's goodbye, Diana. I hate goodbyes. Yeah. Kiss me, Creed, she said sleepily. Kiss me on the lips. I bent down, doing just that. The Amazon queen grabbed the back of my head, kissing me longer than I'd intended, using her tongue. Finally, I pulled away. She was already asleep. I smiled before heading for the door. Chapter 13 Since we captured the moonship and made it ours, we decided to christen it. To my mind, the best name was Santa Maria, Christopher Columbus's flagship. We were about to explore places no human had been before. Sure, the Indians had beaten Columbus to the New World, but Chris had made the world a little smaller with his feet, knitting it together. Wasn't I about to do the same with our galaxy? Before the Earth died the first time, some people had gotten huffy about Columbus. I remember an intense argument in my high school history class. I'd sided with Columbus, saying the man had been a stud, risking everything on a courageous voyage of discovery. I'd had a few fellow students who'd gotten angry with me. It turned out, according to the teacher, that I had made some politically incorrect comments toward them. That had landed me in the office later, getting a good talking to by the principal. Big deal. Who doesn't get sent to the office now and again? The bigger deal had been a few gangbangers waiting for me on my walk home. 
The hombres hadn't liked my comments in class. They proceeded to call me a few names, among them Pendejo and Gringo. I'd seen the way the wind was blowing, five of them against one of me. My palms had turned sweaty and my balls had begun shriveling, looking for a place to hide until this was over. Sometimes a big mouth could land a kid in trouble, especially if he lacked the muscle to back it up. I turned around and ran, which had been a mistake. They ran after me, shouting more insults. Soon enough, my side began to ache. A few of them had scooped up stones, one of them hitting me in the back of the head. It had been just hard enough, so I lost my balance and skidded chest first across pavement. That had torn the front of my shirt and bloodied my chin. I imagine that would have been enough of a chastisement for most of them. One guy, though, the smallest, had strutted around me, giving me several kicks in the side, telling me that's what he would have done to old Columbus. The last time he walked toward me to give me another boot, I reacted, rolling onto my side, catching his foot and yanking as hard as I could. He slammed back hard and fast, his head hitting the ground with an audible crack. I'd already scrambled to my feet while the others stared at their friend. I was a mess, with a torn shirt, blood on my chest, and craziness in my eyes. Mr. Tough Hombre had begun puking and then choking on his vomit. I'd rolled him over face first. He gagged, spewed again, and began to cough hoarsely. Better take him to emergency, I said. He might have a concussion. Maybe we give you a concussion, the biggest one told me. I finally remembered the knife in my backpack. I'd been wearing it the entire time. So I shrugged off the pack, ripped it open, rummaged around, and pulled out my switchblade. Admittedly, I was a bit of a troublemaker in my youth, with plenty of poor decisions to show for it. I clicked open the blade, telling them in so many words to let it go. We're finished here, a different gangbanger said. You go home, gringo. We'll take Jose to emergency. But watch your mouth next time in class or it won't go so good for you. You watch your mouth, I said, getting madder the longer I clutched the knife. Maybe we get knives too, the biggest said. You do what you have to, I told him. Jose started retching again, which was probably good for me. Two of them helped Jose to his feet, taking him away. Some things you don't forget. They get branded in your memory. I was going to call the moonship the Santa Maria in honor of Christopher Columbus because one day as a kid I'd been forced to run away. This was my belated finger against our former politically correct system and against Abaddon, who thought he could wipe humanity off the galactic map. The Santa Maria was huge inside, with hangar bays, endless corridors, chambers, engine rooms, fuel pits, storage facilities, elevators, garden rooms. You get the idea. The repair teams had fixed some of the T-missile damage, maybe a bare hundredth, the most critical hundredth, though. We took along thousands of technicians and engineers, and they worked in shifts around the clock. Other teams, with hordes of shipped tractors, cranes, and other equipment, built laser batteries and plasma cannons, along with missile launch sites on the moon's surface. I didn't want to worry about the personnel, so I had Dmitry Rostov take care of that. He was another of the original assault troopers. Once he learned about our mission, he demanded to come along. That was fine with me. For those who don't know, Dmitry was a Zaporizhian Cossack by nationality. He'd been from the Ukraine. The Cossacks used to be a hard-riding, freedom-loving people from the steppes or plains of Russia and the Ukraine. They were good fighters, but most people recognized them as those acrobatic dancers who squatted low, folded their arms on their chests, and vigorously kicked out their legs. Dmitri was a solid, muscular man, shorter than my 6'3". He had taken to wearing his hair in a straight-up brush cut like Rollo. It felt good to have my old teammates back. N7, Rollo, Ella, and Dmitri. Rollo and I had been together since Antarctica, since the day. Then I'd found Dimitri and Ella in glass tubes, ready for transshipment up to Clath's battle jumper on the day plus one. I called a meeting with the four of them, wondering how soon we should start the great journey. Rollo would run the moonship as its captain. Ella was the chief science officer, while Dimitri took care of personnel, as I've said, and would run security. That would leave me more time to simply think, with N7 as my personal advisor. We sat around a conference table fashioned out of moonstone instead of wood. Ella had a steaming cup of tea, Dimitri a shot of vodka with a bottle beside the glass, Rollo had a beer. N7 kept his hands free and I kept moving my forty-four lying on the stone top. Many of the moon chambers, incidentally, had been hewn out of rock. It gave the ship a cavernous feel, like flying around space in an ancient cave. I kept wondering how the builders had drilled the holes for the electrical equipment behind the scenes. I am struck by the incongruence of our vessel, 
and Seven said. It can transfer, which is stunning. Otherwise, it strikes me as a primitive machine of ancient design. It's a freak of a ship, I agreed. It has a few built-in advantages, though. The biggest is its massive rock armor, an entire moon of it surrounding the deepest structures like the bridge and living quarters. I'm still troubled concerning our motive force, Ella said. I've been studying the transfer mechanism. The doors swished open and Key floated into the chamber, disrupting the meeting. Key wasn't actually shaped like a key or hotel card plastic. It wasn't like a giant ball bearing, either. Key was square, like a metallic cube the size of a desk, with colored lights swirling on all its sides. I couldn't see a way to put anything into Key or open it up to fix the thing. When Key spoke, causing the air to vibrate with sound, the swirling lights pulsed a deeper color and moved in faster rhythms on its sides. You began your meeting without me, Key said. It had an alien feminine voice like a cat person. There was nothing visibly feline about the cube, but that's what I thought if I listened to Key with my eyes closed. This is an exploratory meeting, I said. Here we don't hold anything back. If you're going to stay, you'll have to follow the rules of the meeting. The lights flashed darker on Key's sides. You are suggesting I am not welcome here. Of course you're welcome, I said. You're going to help us into the Fortress of Light, aren't you? Key didn't respond to that. You will help us in, won't you? Ella asked. If the basic conditions are met, certainly, Key said. What are those conditions? Ella asked. I would rather not say, Key said. Why are you withholding the information? Ella asked. I would rather not say, Key replied. Fine, fine, I said. We don't want to put you on the spot. I also wasn't sure how to make Key tell us if the thing didn't want to. We'd have to ease into this, it seemed. I'm curious, Key. What were the conditions of your imprisonment aboard Holgatha? I would rather not say, Key said. And before you ask me why I'd rather not say, I should tell you that I won't explain it. Deciding on yet another approach, I spread my hands. Are you seeing why you're not very helpful to have at the meeting? No. Key said. Now you're just being stubborn, I said. That will put a dampener on our talk, which we can't afford. I'm afraid you're going to have to leave. I do not want to leave, Key said. And I do not believe you can make me. We can make you any time we want to, I said, starting to get angry. I'm curious how you would achieve this feat. I almost retorted hotly. Instead, a thought struck. I sat back with a half-smile, saying... I would rather not say. Dimitri chuckled appreciatively, sipping his vodka. The big metallic cube bobbed up and down in the air as if thinking. I have noted your reactions and can now tell you this was a test. From this point forward, I will react according to what I've learned. Please continue your meeting while I double-check your main transfer unit. We watched Key depart, the doors closing behind it. I don't trust it, Ella said promptly. Me neither, Rollo said with his thick features set. I touched my revolver. Trust is an issue, isn't it? Can we trust Holgatha? Can we trust Key? You don't trust Holgatha? Dimitri asked. Not altogether, I said. There's too much the artifact doesn't tell us. What is the Fortress of Light, for instance? What exactly is Key? Why would Holgatha keep such critical information from us? We should transfer and discover these things for ourselves. Ella said. I picked up the forty-four and shoved it into my holster. Ella, N7, maybe one of you can explain to me how the transfer unit works? I am ashamed to admit this, Ella said, but I have no idea. I would dearly like to know, however. I believe it works on similar principles as the Lohar Dreadnought's ability to move into hyperspace, N7 said. That didn't make any sense. The two operations were quite different. A transfer ship remained in the same universe. A dreadnought moved into hyperspace, something next to normal space but also outside of it. Oh, wait, I said. The dreadnought had a sealed-off area. The Lohars told us it contained a simulated black hole, but we had no way of confirming that. Precisely, N7 said. Our captive Saurians showed us the procedures, but we still don't understand the transfer engine or its fuel. It is all a mystery just as the Dreadnought's hyperspace mechanism was a mystery. I have been pondering our situation, and I have a concern. 
Speak up, I said. That's why we're having this meeting. How many times can our present moonship transfer before it needs refueling or an overhaul? N7 asked. I looked around the table, finally settling onto Ella. Do you have an idea? I asked her. We understand the regular engines well enough, she said, sounding defensive. They're big antimatter drives. As to the transfer mechanism... She shrugged, frowned, and focused on N7. I'm surprised you don't even have a theory. Who said I did not? N7 asked. What is it? I asked. This may sound surprising, N7 said, but I believe the transfer mechanism is partly supernatural in origin and operation. That's preposterous, Ella said. We've transferred before with Holgatha. They were natural occurrences. I do not recall anything supernatural about the process. That is interesting, N7 said. How did these natural occurrences take place? I don't know, Ella said, but I mean to find out. That still does not eliminate the possibility that it is through a supernatural act, N7 said. No, Ella said. I don't accept that. Isn't that simply a matter of your preconditions regarding reality? The android asked. This is absurd, Ella said. An android, a mechanical man, is suggesting supernatural processes to move a spaceship? Does anyone else find that strange? You have stated my condition and belief correctly, N7 said. I find nothing incongruous about the two. Just a minute, I said. Ella was getting angry and I had no idea what N7 was really driving at. It was time to switch topics. Let's not get bogged down. How the ship moves from one location to another isn't critical. I must decline such a view, N7 said. Good enough, I said. For now, though, let's leave it at we don't know how the transfer mechanism works or what fuels it. We do know that we can set the coordinates and transfer to said location. That's all we need at the moment to get from A to B. We're like cavemen with a jet, able to fly it from France to California. We don't need to know how much jet fuel the thing has. We just have to be able to turn it on and fly. Is there a point to this? Ella asked dryly. You bet, I said. I don't fully trust Holgatha or Key. Something is going on with them and it smells. Some of you appear to agree with me. I got nods around the table. Why won't Holgatha take us himself to the Fortress of Light? I asked. Why wasn't he sure it was still there? Can't he see that far? What is your point? Ella asked. I could see that N7's words still had her riled. I tapped a finger on the table, studying them. This transfer power is strange. Popping from one locale to another... I don't know. It seems custom-made to land someone in terrible trouble each jump. To forestall any more delays and any possible trouble, I think we should make a single direct transfer to Sagittarius A-Star. Is that your only reason? Ella asked. No. The other is that we don't know how many transfers the moon ship can make. Why waste them with many transfers? Get everything done as quickly as possible is my thinking. Ella thought about that. That is true after a fashion. We don't know our transfer limit. There is another possibility, however. Maybe a transfer 27,000 light years is too much for our ship. Dimitri drained his shot glass, clicking it onto the table. Isn't it dangerous going against Holgatha's advice? That's the question, all right, I said. I'm saying no, it isn't. If there's one thing I've learned these past years, it's to go with my gut. My instincts tell me to switch it up a bit as to how Holgatha said we should do it. Why would Holgatha try to trick us? Ella asked. I grinned. I can think up as many reasons as there are hours in the day. The artifacts are screwy. Add to that a badden's strangeness and unpredictability, and the more troubling fact that ordinary weapons can't destroy him. You don't believe that's true? Ella asked. I do, as a matter of fact. Abaddon has talked to me across a thousand light years in my dreams. He survived who knows how many thousands of years in a different space-time continuum. If anyone would be hard to kill, it would have to be Abaddon. I mean, we don't even know how to kill Jelk. Last time we tried to butcher cloth, he just floated away. At least we were able to drive him away, Rallo said. That's a point, I said. But if you want to know the truth, I lie awake at night sometimes trying to think up ways to kill cloth. I want the little bastard dead. Ella began to nod. We do not have enough facts to make a reasoned decision. Therefore, it is logical to trust some other mechanism to make the decision. 
Your gut, Commander, is as good a mechanism as others. It's better, I said. Please, let me finish. I inclined my head to her. Your instincts have proven right more often than not. If they were merely random choices, I would expect you to be right only 50% of the time. Therefore, it is logical to depend on your gut feelings, given that we have nothing else concrete to go on. That seems like roundabout reasoning, I said. It is scientific, Ella said, glancing sharply at N7. Right, I said. My gut instincts are scientific. I like that. No, Ella said. Your instincts aren't scientific. That they've been correct more than 50% of the time shows they are not completely random. Therefore, a scientific test proves they are worthwhile in lieu of anything else. Okay, okay, I said. Let us proceed. Are we agreed that we transfer directly to Sagittarius A-star? When do you envision the jump to take place? N7 asked. In six hours, I said. Yes, N7 said. I am agreed. I glanced around the table. No one else added anything. We're running out of time, I said. If we're going to kill Abaddon, and by that save the Earth, we're going to have to succeed on our weapon-gaining mission right away. That means we have almost no margin for error. The others nodded. I stood up. All right, then. Let's get cracking. Chapter 14 Instead of six, it took ten hours with teams of scientists, engineers, and dock personnel to get everything ready for transfer. As a final precaution, I ordered everyone off the moon surface. After thinking about it, it made sense why the enemy hadn't brought starships along on the surface. Perhaps in this older transfer vessel, anything on the surface would disappear. The idea of transferring 27,000 light years in a single moment seemed preposterous, outlandish, and... I am certain this is a supernatural proposition, N7 confided to me on the bridge. This was the same bridge where we'd slaughtered attacking Saurian hordes. It was huge, with over 100 personnel monitoring half as many stations. We'd already torn out some of the ancient computers and installed our own. Even with familiar equipment in critical areas, it had still taken time for our people to understand how to operate the bridge. N7 and Ella, and surprisingly Key, had been instrumental in teaching the others the process. We were deep inside the moon, with our vessel between Jupiter and Neptune. According to the latest reports, Abaddon's superfleet was less than two weeks from Earth. The Grand Armada was a week behind them. I had no idea why Abaddon didn't simply transfer a fleet to hit our planet. Maybe he thought that was redundant. The Grand Armada would never get to Earth in that time to save us. The Grand Armada's numerous vessels simply couldn't pass through the many jump gates fast enough to beat the superfleet. Despite the horror of the situation, I found it interesting that a small thing like moving ships through gates could make such a huge difference in terms of stellar rates of travel. Abaddon's ships were like the soldiers in Napoleon's Grande Armée. The French soldiers had marched more steps per hour than the Austrian and Prussian soldiers could. That had allowed Napoleon greater operational speed, which made a difference strategically and on the battlefield. I took a deep breath. It was time to teleport to the center of the galaxy. I cleared my throat to give the order. Before I could, Ella turned around. Can we really do this? she asked. We're about to find out, I said. By the look on her face, she wanted to ask more. She didn't, though, finally turning back to her people. Let's start, I said. Rollo stood up and began giving orders. His bridge teams worked fast and efficiently. Soon, his various leaders said check or ready. At that point, Rollo pointed at the piloting group. The entire time, a power source whined louder and louder. It seemed as if a turbine somewhere was going into overdrive. Unbelievably, the bridge began to shake. The amount of power necessary to do that boggled the mind. We were actually going to transfer 27,000 light years. Go! Rollo shouted. It's time! Two big men shoved giant levers. It was like something out of a 1950s science fiction movie. The turbine whine became high-pitched. The bridge shook harder. Had I made a terrible mistake trying to go for it in a single leap? Had Holgatha given us honest advice? Should we have made the journey in three separate bounds? If that was true, the Forerunner artifact should have done more to make me trust it. This was partly his fault. I laughed, shaking my head. No matter how hard one tried, the temptation to shift blame to someone or something else was always present. In my head, I'd been doing just that. Whatever happened, I was responsible for it. We're going for it, I shouted. 
I couldn't hear my voice anymore. The whine had become too loud. Suddenly everything changed. One moment the roar was intense and the chamber shook. The next moment silence combined with stillness. Had we made the shift, blown our transfer engine, or found ourselves in some sort of null or limbo world where nothing moved? I was almost too nervous to find out. Ella sucked in her breath, making the first noise. She was staring transfixed at her monitor. I sat in the command chair, unmoving, unblinking, and unbelieving. Had we really done it? Were we now in the center of the galaxy? That would be crazy. I swallowed in a dry throat. Then I raised my hands, staring at them. They looked the same. Yet they'd changed. Had they been broken down and recombined? Was that how the moonship transferred across 27,000 light years? I'm putting the image on the main screen, Commander, Ella said in a soft voice. Had she spoken before that? My neck felt rusted as I moved it. The image on the main screen wavered and then solidified into an amazing sight. In the distance was a supermassive black hole as predicted by Earth scientists. It was bright in the center where the black hole tore down matter and gobbled it up like a hog. Around the supermassive black hole was the accretion disk of matter that swirled around it. Were those broken down suns or planets or both? I'd seen something like this, but on a grander scale in Abaddon's weird space-time continuum. There, everything had shrunk with the shrinking universe. Here, the much smaller supermassive black hole was just the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The other sight was the stars. It was fantastic. Old stars, young stars, massive stars, and small normal stars. On Earth, when you looked up at night, you saw one star per cubic parsec. Here in the galactic center, I saw 1,000 stars per cubic parsec. There was no comparison in grandeur. What is our present speed and heading? N7 asked me. What? I said, sounding bemused. The android repeated the question. Right, I said, straightening, gathering my bearings and beginning to give orders. The sight was grand and glorious, but we had to stay on our toes out here. It took ten minutes to get straightened out. If someone had attacked us during that time, well, they hadn't. So we got the chance to get our act together. Ella turned to me with a huge smile. We can do it, Creed. We can teleport vast distances just like the ancient artifacts can. I nodded, grinning at her. We're in the galactic center, she said. I am awed, Commander. I never thought I'd get to see this. You saw a bad in the supermassive black hole, I said. This isn't as cool as that. That was different, Ella said. For one thing, it was a different space-time continuum. This is our galaxy. I used to think of coming here as a little girl. Now I am here. I am awed, Commander. Simply awed. I grinned stupidly, thinking it must be good for a person to be awed by life now and again. This sight, though. The main bridge doors swished open. Key floated amongst us. I said nothing, watching the cube. Had Holgatha sent a Trojan horse along? Had that been the artifact's plan all along? Why did I distrust the thing so much? Key floated to Ella's main station and hovered there. The colors flashing across its sides became more intense. I shoved out of my chair and sauntered near Key. Amazing, isn't it? Explain your statement, Key said. The sight is truly amazing. Do you refer to your bridge crew working with such efficiency? Key asked. They are working hard, aren't they? I said. They are sluggish by my parameters, Key said. I am finding your species slow and dull-witted. Then the joke is on you, I said, because I wasn't referring to them. What else could you have been referring to? Key asked. Can you see the main screen? I see it. Do you see what we're seeing? I see much more than you do, Key said. I can see into a broader range of colors than you. You're telling me you don't find the supermassive black hole spectacular? I do not. What about the masses of stars? I asked. That is a simple scene one finds at a galactic core. There is no reason for your emotional reactions. We're not machines, I said. I am not a machine. I am a key. I put my hands behind my back. Why are you here, Key? Do you refer to my being on the bridge? That's right. That is a logical question. I am here to inform you that I do not see the Fortress of Light. I am afraid it has fallen into the supermassive black hole. 
My heart thudded and my mouth turned dry. Maybe your processors are off, I suggested. No. The Fortress of Light has been destroyed. That is the obvious conclusion. I merely came here to assure myself what my sensors did not detect. Goodbye, Commander Creed. I am supposed to self-destruct at this point. Do you have any last requests? Uh, yes. Go outside the moon ship to do your self-destruction. I am to self-destruct the transfer vessel with myself. Goodbye, Commander. Ten. Nine. Eight. Chapter 15 What? I said. Six. Five. Four. Key counted. I have a request, I shouted. It is imperative you listen to me. Two. One. Holgatha told me. Abort the countdown sequence, Key said. The amount of flashing lights on its side slowed in color intensity and movement. The cube floated away from Ella's station. I took that as a good sign. I backed up toward my chair. As I did, I noticed the large number of bridge crew staring at me in shock. I told myself to get a grip. It was up to me to save the day. That helped me to collect my thoughts somewhat. I'd been in these situations before. Maybe it would help for me to get pissed off. I had the feeling Holgatha had played a dirty trick on me and humanity in general. I wanted to survive long enough to pay that bastard back. What did Holgatha tell you? Key asked. I plucked at my lower lip, nodding knowingly. I didn't know if Key could understand human gestures or not, but I was going to assume so. As I did that, I kept backing up. Finally, the back of my legs bumped against my command chair. I sat down heavily, trying to figure out the best way to approach this. You are stalling, Commander. Stalling indicates an attempt at subterfuge. That will not help you against me. Believe me, I said. I know that. Because of what Holgatha told you? Key asked, sounding suspicious. Yes, I said on instinct. This is unconscionable, Key said. The artifact promised me it would leave you in the dark concerning the operation. I bet that's what he said. Why would you say that? Key said. It is merely affirming my words. I'm so angry now I could spit. Your statement does not make sense, Key said. Are you angry? I asked. Because I'm freaking livid. Is that because of the loss of the Fortress of Light? That and Holgatha's lies directed toward you. Key hovered a moment without speaking. I am not sure I understood your last words. It pisses me off that Holgatha should lie to you. Why would that be? Key asked. I'm surprised you don't understand. More lights flashed across Key's surfaces. Is this in relation to the Creator? Yes, I said. You worship the Creator? Of course, don't you? I am Key. I was not manufactured for worship. I have entry protocols regarding the Fortress of Light. With its obliteration, I no longer have a function. My protocols demand that I self-destruct, lest I am improperly used for blasphemous purposes. Right, right, I said. I thought as much. Look, Key, Holgatha has kept you trapped for a long time. I know that much. The artifact told you this. Key, I said, smirking. You need to use your logic processors instead of asking stupid questions. But the artifact assured me you knew nothing regarding the higher order priorities. This would indicate deviancy regarding the artifact. That would put in jeopardy. I wondered what he would have said if he'd finished. You were saying? I asked. Commander, I believe that you are lying to me. There have been lies all around, Key. It's disgusting. The lights on its side slowed to such an extent that I could almost see individual points instead of mere streaks of lights. That made me suspicious. A lot about this struck me as wrong. What was Holgatha's angle in this? I've always had the feeling the Forerunner artifact didn't like humanity. Could Holgatha have decided to throw in with Abaddon? That didn't make sense. Abaddon and the Kargs hated non-Karg life. Wasn't the artifact life after a fashion? Wouldn't that mean Holgatha would perish as well if Abaddon won? Commander, Rollo said. There are unidentified objects heading our way. Excuse me, Key, I said. I have to take care of this. Are you saying our conversation is terminated? 
Key asked. No, we haven't even delved into the heart of Holgath's treachery regarding you. Aren't you curious how the artifact tricked you? I am curious indeed. Then we have to delay the conversation so I can give you my full attention as you so richly deserve. But the countdown, Commander. I must continue it at the earliest opportunity. Don't you think I know that? I was unsure, Key said. Your wet body processing centers are foreign to me. Holgatha told me your emotional processes are merely randomizers given to- Hold that thought, Key, I said. If we're going to survive to continue the conversation, I have to look into this now. The lights on its side speeded up. I understand the logic. Take care of the VIP-92 attack vessels. Then we can finish the talk so I can hasten to self-destruct. Good thinking, I said, turning away, heading for Rollo. Did you get that? I asked Rollo quietly. I did, Rollo whispered, indicating the battle screen. Those are VIP-92 attack vessels, whatever they are. His people adjusted the screen. From the outer edge of the accretion disk, three streaks of light moved fast. They avoided the supermassive black hole as they headed toward us. Key said they're attack vessels, Rollo told his people. I want to know what kind of hull armor these ships have. Sir, a lanky tech said. I'm not getting any material readings. Those are energy fields. The man tapped his controls, studying them. If I were to guess, I'd say those are antimatter containment fields. Could Key be wrong about them? I whispered. Rollo eyed Key sidelong. I think so, he whispered back. Despite the lowering of your voices, Key said, I am quite able to hear you. I am not wrong. They are energy ships, VIP-92 attack vessels. They are driven by the Vikai, an ancient life force. I had surmised their energy sphere had already been annihilated by the black hole. By projecting my scanner into a higher visual range, I see their sphere is still active. That is interesting for several reasons. Are the Vikai friendly? I asked. Their hospitality is noted throughout the Galactic Core, Key said. The fact of their approaching combat run is highly unusual. I would submit you have angered a notoriously friendly species. That does not speak well of humans, Commander. What are you talking about? I said. We just got here. If they're friendly, they're not doing a good job of showing it. I attribute that to your hostile nature, Key said. Rollo rubbed his forehead, leaning near me. Is that thing insane? Is the Galactic Center crazy? Forget about that, I said. Ella, N7, what should we fire against the approaching energy vessels? Let's try communicating with them first, Ella suggested. Yes, I told Rollo. Give it a try. The energy vessels increased speed. They were several billion kilometers away, but closing fast. Rollo tried hailing them with our advanced comm equipment. Nothing happened. Key, I said, spinning around. You do realize this is all new to us. I had begun to wonder, Key said. I can find no other explanation for your odd actions. Why do you attribute aggressive intent to us when they're the ones making an attack run? Perhaps it is because the V-Kai are noted for their discriminating nature, Key said. Perhaps it is the nature of our ship, N7 said, speaking up. Maybe Abaddon has already attacked here. Perhaps the energy creatures... You have made a fundamental mistake, Key said, interrupting. The V-Kai are not energy beings. They simply use energy vessels. Inside the ship is a protective force field shielding the material creatures. Rollo ordered his comm people to use different frequencies and manners of communication. Before they had exhausted all the possibilities, the energy vessels came within a million kilometers of us. Use everything, I said. Lasers, particle beams, plasma cannons, and T-missiles. Commander! Rollo shouted. I looked up at the main screen. A blob of energy detached from each attack vessel. The blobs vanished like T-missiles and reappeared several kilometers from our ship. One after another, the energy blobs closed the distance, striking the surface, exploding, sending alien pulses into our vessel. Engines stopped. Ventilating systems overheated. Electrical power went out in many portions of the ship. Fire back! I shouted. Hit those bastards! They're too far away! Rollo said. Launch T-missiles, I said. How? Rollo asked. We're cut off from our own surface. We can't even give them orders now. Maybe someone used their own initiative, Ella said, indicating a working screen. It was one of the few left projecting images. A T-missile appeared near a V-Kai vessel. 
The warhead ignited with a thermonuclear blast. I leaned forward in the dim glow of emergency power. One million kilometers away, a VIP-92 attack vessel winked out of existence. I led the cheering. Stop, stop, Key said. The colors were going wild on its sides. What's wrong? I asked. This is a barbaric display of bloodthirstiness. I find it distressing. Yeah, they struck us first. We just hit back harder. I must have done it, Commander, Rollo said. The other two vessels are running away. It may be too late for us, Ellis said, studying her panel. We're losing power all over the ship. Tell everyone to suit up, I said. Ella nodded. That will help for a little while, but if we can't get the systems back online, we're going to run out of oxygen before long. And we can forget about transferring again. Commander, I think we might be stranded out here in the galactic core. Chapter 16 I took a deep breath before saying anything. I heard the fear in Ella's voice. I could see the frightened faces of those at their stations. I was responsible for them. I had to get us home again. First, I had to find this fortress of light. I know, Key said the fortress was gone. I wasn't taking anything at face value out here, though. The sudden attack by energy vessels with regular creatures inside the weird ships? No, I didn't buy this was by accident. It felt like a setup. Here's the first rule I learned a long time ago in the Jelk Corporation, I said loudly. Don't panic. Yeah, we're in a tough spot, I shrugged. We've been in tough spots before and won through. We will here, too. The first thing, though, I pointed at Dimitri. Don't panic, the Cossack said in his cheerful manner. Right, Ella? I asked. She looked green around the gills, a prime candidate for panicking. Start by figuring out what kind of energy blast they hit us with, I told her. How am I supposed to do that? She asked, her voice rising as she spoke. Ella Timoshenko, I said firmly. She blinked several times before licking her lips. This is the Galactic Center, Commander. We're at Sagittarius A-Star. Good. Now figure out what I asked for and get your people working on it. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Her eyes narrowed. Ella hated supernatural explanations for anything. A bite of anger took hold. I could see it in her eyes. She turned to her nearest team and began to give orders in a calm voice. One of the keys to leadership was having good lieutenants. I had the best. N7, I said. You're coming with me. Key floated after me. Commander, if we could finish our conversation, please. I would like to initiate my full countdown before all of you die. I don't have time for that now, I said. This is an emergency. I see. If you're otherwise occupied, I have my own protocols to follow. I marched up to Key and put my hands on my hips. Now you listen here. You're not going to destroy my ship because you messed up. That is untrue. I did my duty. I have messed up nothing. Ha! I barked. It's completely true. I happen to know where the Fortress of Light is. That's what you're supposed to find, right? It has disappeared, Commander. Wrong, I said. You simply don't know where to look. That is nonsensical. If you don't even know what the Fortress of Light is, how can you know its location? You have made an error, I said. Come back to me once you figure it out. Then seven, let's go. Commander, Key said. I realize my error. Yes, I asked, wondering what it would say. Holgatha must have given you information regarding the Fortress of Light. There you go, I said. You give me hope that my time with you isn't completely a waste of time. I'm going to get back with you, Key. First, you have to let me do my job. I have analyzed your speech patterns, Key said. You are telling the truth. Therefore, I will wait. I hurried out with N7 because I was lying through my teeth. It was a good thing I was a natural liar. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. I'd learned some time ago how to deal with logical artificial intelligences. It wasn't easy and took quick thinking. I shook my head. I couldn't worry about Key at the moment. First, I had to get my ship running if it was possible. I'd worry about finding this missing fortress of light later. As I hurried down a corridor with N7, I had a nagging thought. What had Holgatha hoped to gain by this? Just whose side was the Forerunner artifact on? Did the thing even know? I could already smell the air's staleness. We had to get at least part of the ship running again. Who knew if the two VIP-92 attack vessels had gone to get reinforcements or not?
Three hours later found us in an even worse condition. The energy blasts had knocked down almost everything. Everyone I saw wore a vac suit or a bio suit. I wondered about the rest of the moon ship. It was vast, obviously, with over 10,000 operatives on board. Some parts of the ship could have been in entirely different countries, given that they were over a thousand kilometers away. I was back on the bridge, scowling in my helmet. The bridge was empty except for me. The others were elsewhere, working on repairs. Key was gone, too. I wondered idly where the pesky thing had gone. Flickering light caught my eye. I looked up. The main screen had gone blank some time ago. It was on again and growing brighter. I sat up, pushed myself to my feet, and approached the screen. It showed the supermassive black hole. Pin dot lights rose from a section of the accretion disk. Could anyone live in the disk? I glanced around, saw a blinking bank of controls, and went to them. I began to test the controls. After a few taps, I looked up at the screen. Finally, I managed to zoom in on the lights rising from the disk. There were hundreds of them. To my untrained eye, each of them looked like a VIP-92 attack vessel. No, that wasn't exactly right. Some of those ships, if that was what they were, looked substantially larger than the others. What I found interesting was that our battle tech had been good enough to kill one of the attackers. How many T-missiles did we have left? I had no idea. Most, if not all, of the T-missiles were near the surface hatches. I would have to race through literally thousands of kilometers of corridors to reach the surface. By the time I got there, the VIP-92s would have already made their attack. I hurried to the comm consoles, sitting down at one, letting my fingers rove over controls. I knew how to work these better than the main screen controls. Approximately ten minutes later, I got a response. It was a crackle of noise at what seemed like high-pitched speed. As I tried to puzzle that out, I heard a sound behind me. Turning, I saw a key hovering in place. How long had the thing been behind me, watching? Did you hear that? I asked. I did, Commander. I would advise you to finish your conversation with me as we are almost out of time. Was that the Vikai responding to my queries? I asked. Why are you asking me? You heard the transmission. I did, but I don't understand their language. Commander, do you expect me to believe that? I am not in the habit of lying, Key. Are you suggesting I am? I don't know, Key. Are you? That is a slur against my builders, which is to say against the Creator. I found the statement shocking. The Creator directly fashioned you? Not directly, no, Key said. But certainly indirectly. I frowned. How do you know that to be true? Commander, it is self-evident. We do not have the time to argue over fundamental truisms. The attack vessels are racing here to finish what you started. What? Wait just a minute. We didn't start anything. That isn't what the V-Kai just said. What did they say? I asked. Please, Commander, Key said, sounding miffed. I am not a translation unit. I am a Key. His reaction gave me an idea. Wouldn't some worth be better than no worth at all? I asked. Explain that, Key said. You said the Fortress of Light has vanished. If it really is gone, so is your purpose as a key, which leads you to think self-termination is in order. Now, however, I offer you value as a translation unit. Since you now have value, self-termination is no longer necessary. I was not made to be a translation unit. Welcome to the club. That statement means nothing to me, Key said. What club are you referring to? And why should I be welcomed to it? I was designed to live in luxury, served by a thousand playboy bunnies, I said. Instead, I have been forced to work for a living. I had not realized this, Key said. I shrugged as sweat began to trickle under my armpits, pretending to remain cool while stressed, arguing with an overintelligent robotic... Yes, Key said suddenly. I will translate for you. The essence of the message was the V-Kai opinion leader giving you a list of offenses. To begin with, you appeared in a restricted zone without proper licensing, without any explanation, and in clear violation of the Civilizational Value Index. Uh, what's a Civilizational Value Index? I asked. The lights flashed faster across Key, and it spoke in a reproving tone. It amazes me that you would agree to transfer without knowledge of something so fundamental. That was rash, Commander. Did the V-Kai opinion leader say what he intends to do? I asked. That is self-evident. The V-Kai will destroy your ship in retaliation for your offenses. 
I squeezed my eyes shut, reminding myself that aliens were different from us. They would not think like us, nor act like us. If their actions seemed unreasonable, that was because I didn't understand their mode of thinking. Opening my eyes, I asked, I would appreciate it if you could explain what the Civilizational Value Index is. I am surprised, Key said. That is actually a reasonable and logical request. The concept is quite simple, really. The galaxy is cordoned off into varying levels of civilization. For example, Earth has a 6C civilizational score. Immediate questions popped into my mind. Who gave the scores and enforced the cordoning? Instead, I asked, what is the Lohar homeworld score? The homeworld specifically isn't scored, Key said. The Lohar are scored as a species. Got it, I said. So what's their score? 6B. And the Vikai? I asked. The last time I checked, they hovered between a 2A and a 1E score. Yet we destroyed one of their VIP-92s. Yes, Key said. I find that remarkable. That must be due to your heritage as killers. It must be true what Holgatha suspects about humans. That being what, exactly? I asked. We are drifting afield, Commander. We will stick to the issue. I find it interesting that you appear to have surmised a technological ability commensurate with a civilizational score. The basis is not one for one, but normally it is close. Thus, a 2A species should demolish a 6C species in space combat. However, the moon ship originally belonged to a 1C species. Since its construction, though, the ship's technological superiority has slipped into a 3E state, except for its marvelous transfer ability. That is a 1 AAA technological achievement. As Key spoke, I studied the main screen. The flow of energy ships from the accretion disk had grown. It wasn't just hundreds of vessels. This looked like thousands upon thousands were headed at us. So you're saying the galaxy is divided into different civilizational zones? I asked. I have already stated so, Commander. Why are you being redundant? And the V Kai are angry with us because we've entered a place we shouldn't have? That is merely the first of your offensives. Holgatha must have known about these different zones. He is a forerunner artifact, Key said. Of course Holgatha knew. I nodded slowly, trying to envision what Key was suggesting. Our galaxy was full of aliens. The slower, less developed aliens lived on the fringes, it would appear. The smartest, most advanced aliens lived in the galactic core. The smart ones didn't want the dumb ones loitering in their zone. Out of all the dangers brought about by transferring, I would not have thought of this. Why did Holgatha choose to live in the less developed part of the galaxy? I asked. That is an interesting question, Key said. It is deserving of careful speculation. Unfortunately, we do not possess the time at the moment. As if to punctuate Key's point, another blast of high-speed screeches burst through the comm unit. What are the V-Kai saying now? I asked. Key did not respond. Since I was wearing my helmet, I didn't notice right away. Finally, though, I saw a blaze of colored lights playing off the reflection of the comm screen. I turned. Key had gone wild, with intense colors zipping across his sides. What is it? I said. What did they say? You don't understand, Key said in a soft voice. That was not the V. Kai speaking. That was the voice of the curator. He bids you to enter the museum as sanctuary from the coming assault. What museum? I said, looking up at the main screen. I saw it right away. It was on the other side of the accretion disk as the V. Kai energy vessels. The thing was built like Key, only on a vaster scale. It was a gigantic cube of multicolors that shined with even greater brilliance than the black hole. Is that the Fortress of Light? That is one of the most ancient titles, Key said. The curator has offered you sanctuary. This is marvelous and stupendous. The honor you have just received. Okay, okay, settle down, Key. This is a great and glorious moment. How do we get there before the V-Kai swarm reaches us? I do not believe such a thing is possible. You are quite doomed. Still, it is good to know that you humans can die with full and righteous honor. Chapter 17 What kind of key are you, anyway? I demanded. Tell the curator we're having a little trouble. Maybe he can lend us a hand in getting to the fortress. The metallic cube turned in the air as if to regard me closer. That is against all the dictates of the museum, Key said as if offended. 
If your ship lacks motive power, the ancient structure will no doubt vanish back into the accretion disk. That you were allowed to look upon the great fortress. Wait, 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 I shouted. Why would the curator abandon us? None of this makes sense. That is because you are civilizationally too dull-witted to realize the honor he has done you, Key said. I opened channels in my helmet com. Ella, N7, I said. Come to the bridge right away. We have an emergency. I watched the stream of energy vessels swing toward the moon ship. This group had started farther away than the first three that had attacked us, but they were moving fast, getting much too close much too soon. At that moment, another burst of high-speech screeches assaulted my ears. The curator is wondering why you don't answer him, Key told me. Tell him I'm preparing the proper reply. I'm surprised at you, Commander. That is a thoughtful response. Yes, I will tell him that. Key made a volley of similar screeching noises. At that point, Ella and N7 rushed onto the bridge. As quickly as I could, I explained the situation to them. N7, still in his body armor, raced to a station, hurriedly tapping on a console. Given the range of their last attack, N7 said, from one million kilometers away, I estimate we have 14 minutes before the V-Kai bombardment begins. How soon until we're obliterated after that, I am unwilling to estimate. I'm sure your obliteration will occur in less than ten of your minuscule time units after the beginning assault, Key said. Are you referring to minutes? N7 asked Key. I am. Ella, I said. How long until the ship has full power again? You can forget about that, she said. I can give you some operational abilities by connecting you with the surface. We can launch T-missiles and possibly activate laser turrets. I could open the hangar bay doors and let our few fighters launch. More than that, however... She shook her helmeted head. It is a pity for you, Key said. But your glorious adventure is over. I am at peace, however, as I was among you as you witnessed the appearance of the Fortress of Light. Commander, I will take my leave now. I believe I can reach the moon surface before the attack run begins. I will tell the curator all that transpired here. How will you get from the moon ship to the fortress? I asked. It will take me many of your years to do so, Key said. Once I begin the initial trajectory, I can drift the rest of the way while shutting down all but my most necessary functions. Since we can't travel there directly, why don't we transfer to the fortress? I asked. No, no, Key said. That is ethically and aesthetically wrong. One does not transfer a distance he can easily traverse by regular means. It simply would not be proper, Commander. Ella and I exchanged glances. I'll get right on it, she said. Commander, Key said, sounding indignant. I cannot believe you would try something like this after I just informed you. Key, I said loudly, interrupting it. Yes, Commander. Shut the hell up. You're giving me a headache. The metallic cube bobbed up and down in the air, its light slowing their speed and brightness. Finally, the thing made noises. I checked. Key had sent the sounds through the comm channel. What did you just tell the curator? I asked. Key remained silent. Key, I'm talking to you. You told me to shut up. I did, but you didn't listen to me. You sent a message to the curator, didn't you? I did, Key admitted. I told him we cannot reach him. I have no doubt he will now take the museum elsewhere. I turned fast, looking up at the main screen. It might have been a trick of light or my imagination, but the Fortress of Light didn't seem to shine as brightly. Then it moved. The giant cube began to sink toward the accretion disk. I swore roundly at Key until Ella touched my sleeve. I need your help, Commander, she said. We have to coordinate this as fast as we can. Even then it might be too late. What can I do to help? N7 asked. Stand by the rods, Ella said. You'll have to pull them at exactly the right moment. I fed data as Ella rattled off instructions. I kept glancing at the main screen as I worked, noticing a continual dimming of the great cube fortress. Concentrate, Commander, Ella shouted at me over the helmet comm. I did. We had enough power on the bridge for most of the instruments to work. I typed madly as Ella spoke faster and faster. N7 dashed back and forth on the bridge. He fed the great machine more coordinates. I need more time, Ella shouted. The Vikai swarm was approaching fast. It would soon be where the first three had launched their electrical bombs. By this time, the Fortress of Light had almost disappeared from the main screen. 
The initial VIP-92 attack vessels launched energy blobs. The first one disappeared from sight. Now, I shouted. Pull the levers, N7. Pull them. No, Ella shouted. I need to make several more adjustments. N7 followed my orders instead of hers. With a hand on each lever, the android tugged hard. The first energy blob must have struck the moon's surface. The bridge shook and lights flickered. At the same instant, a sick feeling swirled across my chest. Everything went dark all at once. A second later, light splashed across my brain. I groaned, clutching my helmet. It felt as if my world spun around and around. I clenched my teeth so I wouldn't vomit. Did more energy blobs strike the ship? Everything shuddered. Everything spun and twirled. I heard garbled noises and... All at once, it stopped. There was no sound, no sight, no smell, no hot or cold, nothing. I think we may have transferred into a null zone or a limbo void. I wanted to groan. This was one of the worst and most helpless feelings in my life. Chapter 18 All at once, sights, sounds, and feelings rushed into me with heightened force. I staggered, struck a console, rebounded the other way, and crashed onto my side on the deck. That likely saved my life. For that instant, a bolt of what seemed to be electricity smashed against the panel I'd been standing at, causing it to explode in a shower of sparks and plastic shards. I looked up from the floor. A humanoid, electricity-crackling thing oozed from the wall, the moon rock. It was like a stick figure of electricity, with a wand or rod aimed at where the discharge had hit. I noticed for just a moment an aperture or hole, as if the rod was a gun that fired electrical bolts. Key made screeching sounds, rushing the humanoid thing. The electrical thing turned, aimed the rod, and fired another bolt. Key dodged upward at the last moment. The bolt struck another panel, sending pieces flying everywhere. Were we under attack? I mean, did this have anything to do with the blob shot at the moon ship? Could these be V-Kai versions of assault troopers? If that was true, what did they want? The electrical humanoid aimed at Key once more, firing another bolt. Key was good. He dodged to the left this time. Now N7 was up. He swung a pulse rifle off his shoulder. The V-Kai trooper fired at N7. The android dropped onto his chest. The bolt passed over him. N7 fired three pulses into the thing in return. Each pulse caused the electrical thing to darken for just a moment. The V-Kai seemed to move a little slower, too. But that was it. Seconds later, the ill effect seemed to have vanished from it. N7 didn't stop, though. He kept firing pulses at the thing. That made the attacker sluggish, but he finally nailed N7 with an electrical bolt. N7's armor blackened as pieces spun off. N7, I said through my helmet comm. All I heard was static. I scrambled off the floor, dashing to my pulse rifle where I'd laid it down by the command chair. The attacker saw me, firing several electrical discharges. Even though I dodged the bolts, I could feel a current flowing through my body, setting my teeth on edge. Did he want to capture us? At the last moment, I dove, skidding across the deck. I snatched my rifle, rolled to dodge another bolt, and targeted my weapon on the Galactic Core native. One pulse after another darkened his torso area. In frustration, he backed into the wall, oozing out of sight. Check N7, I shouted at Ella. Key, what is this all about? Raiders, Key said. Some of the V-Kai must have made it onto the ship before we transferred. Where are we now? I shouted. I do not know. Key said. They want to destroy me, it appears. That is most odd. Most odd indeed. Before Key could say more, three electrical attackers oozed out of the moon rock. I had no idea how they could do that. It must have been similar to the way I entered Holgatha. They shot as one, sending bolts at Key. The cube dodged the first two, but failed to miss the third. The discharge struck Key, drilling a hole into a side. That caused an explosion, and Key tumbled through the air to crash against a bulkhead. The heavy metallic cube struck the deck, all the colors having vanished from its sides. It left Key a dull iron color with smoke pouring from the hole. Now the attackers turned toward Ella and me. She dove and rolled as two bolts sizzled across the deck where she'd been. One aimed at me, but he turned as the doors to the bridge swished open. Three crew members rushed in. They wore ordinary vac suits. Get back, I shouted. The three didn't hear me or didn't have time. The nearest V-Kai aimed and fired, sending bolts into them. These were ordinary men, not modified assault troopers. The discharges blew gaping, smoking craters in them, hurling them backward and sending up oily smoke. 
Each of them shuddered and died. I rose to one knee and fired pulses into the killer. He darkened, grew sluggish, and headed for the wall, no doubt to disappear and recharge if he could. The other two fired at me. One hit the pulse rifle, shattering it in my hands. The electrical effect made my teeth ache. Hurling the broken weapon from me, I scrambled for cover as bolts zigzagged above me. The raiders had killed three of my crew, incapacitated and maybe destroyed Key and wounded N7. Now I'd lost my pulse rifle. Maybe I could get N7s. Even as I thought that, one of the electrical bastards zapped the android's weapon into several glowing pieces. Three of them. A lousy three of them were taking over the bridge. Where had everyone gone? I knew a lot of people were trying to fix the various systems, but... I remembered my 44 then. How could I ever have forgotten? Yes, it was an old-fashioned weapon for this space age, but it had done its duty before. One of the electrical people spoke in a screeching manner. Were they calling on me to surrender? What do we do now, Commander? Ella asked over her crackling helmet comm. I thumbed back the hammer on my 44, rose from behind a console, and saw a V-Kai flowing toward me. It seemed to be running and moving like lightning at the same time. It was wicked strange. Boom! I sent lead into his chest. The result was greater than I would have expected. The bullet struck the electrical creature and blew it backward. A sheet of electricity seemed to fly off it, exposing flesh underneath, as if an ordinary person was inside the electrical suit. That was so weird it kept me from firing a second time right away. The V-Kai fell down, rose, fell again, and finally aimed his electrical gun at me. Boom! I sent a shell at his head. It blew away another piece of electrical armor, if that's what I was seeing, to show me a man with red eyes and what appeared to be a bruise on his skin. Without thinking, boom! I sent another round at the exposed flesh. The V-Kai catapulted off his feet to land on his back. Blood from his face boiled on his outer electrical suit. I crossed him off from a mental list. I think he was dead. I had a weapon that could hurt the other two. One of those noticed me. He flowed fast for the wall. Boom! Boom! The bastard didn't make it. He was on the floor, writhing as his blood boiled onto his outer suit. I'd used the first shot to open his armor, the second to send a slug into him. At that point, I was up and running. The third V-Kai approached the dull-colored key. He stood over the poor thing, tracing his electrical gun along a side. What was the alien thinking? The V-Kai knelt by the block of metal, put an electrical arm on it, and pressed something on his belt. Both of them began flowing with electrical power. As one, they rose. Slowly, almost staggeringly, the V-Kai carried Key toward the nearest wall. I think he planned to escape with Key. I raced after him. Maybe he heard me. He half-turned, raised the electrical gun. Boom! Boom! Click. I put two rounds into him. They were side by side instead of one on top of the other. The second one would have killed him, I'm sure, if it entered the creature in the armor. Instead, pieces of electrical armor flew off, exposing his skin. The shots had caused the alien to drop his gun. The weapon didn't fall on the floor, but flowed into his electrical suit. That was a nice touch. I could have used that on a battlefield or two. In any case, I was out of bullets. There were more in my room, but I didn't have time to go there. I grabbed a spare pulse rifle from a rack. The bastard flowed away faster, heading for a wall. He still carried the key in his electrical hold. Stop! I shouted. He turned to look at me. All I saw was the living, jumping electricity that was his suit. Okay, then. I laid down a barrage of pulse shots, darkening his armor. He reached the wall and tried to flow into it, but it was no use. I must have damaged the suit just enough to erase that ability from his toolkit. Manipulating his electrical suit, the V-Kai let the dull-colored key drop away from him. The heavy cube rolled onto the deck. For a second time, the attacker tried to flow into the wall, this time beginning to get away. I slapped another energy pack into the pulse rifle. At the same time, Ella began firing. We pumped one pulse after another into the V-Kai. Gouts of electricity began to sizzle in the air. His suit darkened with him halfway into the wall. Abruptly, it shut off. At least, that's what I figured happened. He froze, half in the moon wall and half out. All the electricity simply stopped. It left a dead V-Kai stuck in the wall. The suit, I noticed as I approached, was a network of connections like something from advanced laser tag. Is he dead? Ella asked. I turned around. She'd taken off her helmet. With a few clicks, I removed mine. The air smelled how you'd figure it should. 
It had the fresh smell of after a thunderstorm, but the horrid stench of burned flesh. It was a terrible mixture. I walked closer to the dead V. Kai in the wall. His face was outside of the rock. The alien had a much thinner face than a human would have. His body was thinner, too. Maybe I should call them skinnies, from an old sci-fi novel I'd read as a kid. I didn't see how the skinnies had a right to think of themselves as our superiors. This one might have passed for human on a busy New York City street, especially if it had been a rainy day and he'd worn a raincoat. I moved to key and tapped on it firmly. The thing sounded solid. Nothing happened, though. Was it destroyed or just badly damaged? Did we transfer? Ella asked. N7, I said. I ran to the android, unbuckling his combat armor. His eyelids flickered as I pulled off his helmet. Creed, he said dully. Did you defeat them? The three that made it here, I said. I don't know if there were any others, though. Ella was at a comm control. She tapped it, asking if anyone could hear her. She tried several times without receiving an answer. Just then, the main bridge doors swished open. I didn't know what to expect. The last thing in the world I would have thought to see was exactly what walked through to greet us. Chapter 19 I was wearing my bio suit minus the helmet. The pulse rifle in my hand slipped free, clattering onto the deck. That startled me, so I frowned at the seemingly old man walking onto the bridge. He was big, almost a giant, wore a long blue robe that hid his feet and had a great white beard like some mountain man, or the way a lot of people picture God. His eyes were blue and dangerous looking, not kindly and simple. I cleared my throat but hesitated to speak first. There was something intimidating about him. The big old man stopped, taking in the scene, the dead V. Kai on the deck, the one frozen in the rock, and Key's now dull-colored cube. The old man nodded slightly, as if to himself. Ah, uh, I said, finding my tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth. The old man looked at me and raised his bushy eyebrows. Ah, uh, I repeated, finally tearing my tongue loose. Even so, I hesitated. Maybe Ella didn't believe in supernatural manifestations, but I sure did. Now, I hadn't read the Bible much, although I knew a few stories. I seemed to recall that no one had ever looked upon the face of God and lived. I was living and looking at this old man. Maybe this was an alien then, an energy creature, and it read my mind. It knew how I conceived of God and came in that guise to trick me. Surely that was the explanation for this. Whatever the case, the old man seemed dangerous and capable. He frightened me, if you want to know the truth. He hadn't threatened us directly, yet, but I didn't feel my usual cockiness. Sir, I said. Then I hesitated for the third time. I glanced at Ella. She was frowning severely as she bit her lower lip. N7 had raised his head from where he lay on the floor, staring quietly at the big old man. On impulse, I went to one knee and bowed my head as if to a king. Sir, I said again, if any of my actions appear to be disrespectful, please know that I only meant to honor you. I am from, at least I believe I'm from a 6C civilizational zone. If I have erred in coming to the Galactic Corps, please know I only did so in order to rescue my race from certain doom. I could feel Ella's stare burning into my back. She'd likely never seen me act like this. I'm unsure what I should call you, I added. The curator will do, the old man said in a deadly deep voice. I nodded. Curator, I said. Your presence would imply we made it to your museum. It isn't mine, he said, although it is correct to say that I am running the museum for now. I looked up at him to see if he was smiling. He was not. He had fixed those hard blue eyes on me. I felt as if he judged my worth. It was an uncomfortable feeling. Yet I did not get the sense he was condemning me. Key also said this is called the Fortress of Light, I said. Among other names, he said. Ah, uh, are we in trouble? I asked. A great deal, he said. The most pressing problem at the moment are the V. Kai storming the vessel. What? He indicated the skinny frozen in the wall. You dealt with the central team, but no... What are you called? I'm Commander Creed. 
Commander, several assault pods made it onto the survey vessel before you transferred directly into the ancient hangar bay. I suspect old protocols took over. You must, of course, clear this infestation at once. Otherwise, I will flush the ship with anti-force, ridding it of the Vikai and you fringe dwellers in one sweep. Sir? I asked. The Vikai have tried to break into the museum for... Hmm, he said, studying me. You are a short-lived race, I suspect. Your time units... He held up a big, beefy hand. The fingertips glowed as if embedded with electronic equipment. I felt lightheaded watching this and had to steady myself with a hand on a console. That is the way of it, eh? He said. For over ten thousand years, ten thousand of your world circuits around its sun, the Vikai have attempted to find the museum. This is a momentous occurrence for them. If any of their initial teams breaks out of the survey vessel, they will be sure to give the coordinates to thousands more waiting outside. Then the fortress will swarm with enemy. Then... He plucked at his beard. I'm afraid I will have to flush the vessel immediately. I cannot risk further infestations at this time. Perhaps that is fitting. I realize you did not mean me any harm, but you've brought this about through your rash actions. You will have to accept the price of your thoughtlessness. I wasn't going to accept anything if I could help it. Maybe if you and I work together, curator. You are fighting creatures, he said sharply, interrupting me. I realize you hate the idea of defeat. I quite understand. Therefore, to be merciful, I shall give you ten minutes to make your peace. Curator, N7 said, I have an idea. The old man jerked around, frowning at N7. The soulless automaton speaks. I find you unsettling, machine. No, you will remain silent in my presence. Just a minute, sir, I said, hurrying to N7, kneeling beside him. What's your idea? I whispered. N7 glanced at the old man. The near giant had turned away to study the rest of the bridge. The curator said the ship is infested with V. Kai, N7 whispered to me. Yet he has appeared in the center of the ship. That would indicate he's able to teleport from one location to another. Perhaps he can move a combat team to the various infested locales, as he calls them. We will rid the ship of the V. Kai for him within his time limit. I looked up, ready to repeat N7's idea. The curator was staring at us, and he didn't look pleased. I heard him, he said heavily. I am unhappy to hear his voice after telling him to keep quiet. Still, it is a sound idea, and it has been several eons since I've spoken with fringe dwellers such as you. Also, you have returned my survey vessel to me. Yes. I shall give you this opportunity, then. Ten minutes. If we can pull this off in ten minutes, I shall let you remain in the Orion Arm exhibit until the lot of you die of old age. Chapter 20 Before we began the ship-clearing assault, I implored the curator to take me to my quarters so I could reload the magnum. The curator agreed, and he explained the process to us. It was simple and to the point. You must stay in a tight circle around me. I do not feel like expending more energy than is seemly. That would be inelegant and wasteful. Do you understand? I nodded as he seemed impatient. Ella and Seven and I stood by him as the curator manipulated his thick fingers. The tips glowed as before. I heard a sizzle of energy, smelled something sharp, and heard air displacement as we appeared in my quarters. I staggered. Ella fell flat while N7 stumbled against the curator. The old man shoved the android away, sending N7 crashing against a bulkhead. Do not presume to touch me again, the curator told a prone N7. I kept my opinions to myself, snatching several boxes of ammo. I flipped open the 44 cylinder shoving bullets into the chambers. As I did, N7 picked himself up and Ella stood as she checked her pulse rifle. Soon the three of us circled the curator again. N7 tugged my arm and indicated the old man. I shook my head. N7 gave me an imploring look. It was so pathetic I relented. 
curator, I said. The old man grunted a monosyllable response. N7 is sorry for touching you, I said. The curator scowled at me. N7 continued to motion urgently. He, uh, won't do it again, I added. The machine had better not, the curator said. Once is more than I will tolerate. Now cease your chatter and ready yourselves for war. Are you ready? Yes, curator, I said. Then let me think, the old man said, bowing his head. Ah, this is a terrible manifestation indeed. I should caution you that we're about to enter a hot zone. The V-Kai have already slain several hundred of your people. I gripped my gun harder. I hadn't realized that. Let's go, sir. I hear the anger in your voice, trooper, the curator said. That is the proper attitude for this. The V-Kai are merciless ravagers. That isn't what Key had told us, but I decided to keep that to myself. The curator's fingertips glowed, and the same disorientation occurred as before. This time, though, we appeared in a corner of a vast engine compartment. Great cylinders purred with power and entire banks of wall controls flashed with lights. Scattered throughout the mighty chamber were over one hundred charred corpses. Smoke still rose from some while a horrible stench clung in the air. As we appeared, twenty assault troopers in biosuits traded shots with twice that number of electrical flashing humanoids. I began to fire, holding my gun in both hands. Boom! Boom! An electrical soldier stumbled onto the deck. I swiveled slightly. Boom! Boom! One pitched off his feet. The rest of the V-Kai noticed after the third invader sizzled on the deck, with blood flowing from the opening in his weird body armor. They targeted me, of course. I stayed near the curator. I figured Mr. Super High Tech would have some sort of defense. Each V-Kai bolt zigzagged toward me. Many appeared to be right on target. None of those reached me, however. They stopped a body's length away as if smashing up against a force field. I'd guessed correctly about the old man. A thought struck me then. Why had the force field let me in while keeping everything else out? The curator must have allowed me in. Without the slightest qualm, I took full advantage of the situation, dumping empty cartridges onto the deck and reloading. I should have had speed loads, but didn't. Several times my fingers shook as I tried to shove bullets in the chambers. They're retreating, Ella shouted. The V-Kai weren't stupid. Once they realized they couldn't do anything to me, provided I stayed near the curator, they must have figured it was time to regroup elsewhere. Boom, boom, I moved the gun. Boom, boom. Don't let any get away, the curator said. I do not have time for that. I will use anti-force against all of you if you fail. I glanced at him. The old man seemed serene. The eyes, though, swirled with menace. This dude meant what he said. Gotcha, I said. I left the magic circle of his protection, racing after the retreating V-Kai. Boom, boom, one pitched to the deck. I recited. Boom, boom, another stumbled onto his skinny knees. I used the power of my bio suit, making long leaps, gaining speed as I went. Boom, boom. This time, as I ran, I reloaded without shaking fingers. I was in the zone, hating these bastards for killing my people. The remaining V-Kai spun around. I guess they were angry with me. Now, though, things had changed considerably. The remaining assault troopers saw that it was possible to kill the invaders. They lay on their bellies or aimed from behind heavy instruments, firing rapid pulse rifle volleys. That slowed the electrical suit some. Even better, an intense concentration of pulse hits could short-circuit a suit. At that point, three pulse shots killed a skinny. The enemy began going down in droves once my troopers figured that out. Before the last V-Kai died, a bolt tore into my bio suit. The discharge turned me rigid with waves of pain. The bio suit malfunctioned and began flowing off me. I tried to twist away, but another electrical bolt struck. This one shattered my visor. Foul air billowed against me. The stench made me double over and gag. I rolled away from the last bolt and lay there panting. I'm not sure how much time passed. The next thing I knew, the curator looked down on me. Is that it? he asked in his deep voice. Are you done? No, I said, trying to get up, but I couldn't. My bio suit had stopped flowing off me, but it was hard like stiff rubber. It appears that you are done, the curator said. That is a pity. Oh, well, I gave you an opportunity for life. You must admit that, yes? 
I'm not done, I said. I closed my eyes, concentrated, and found that the suit didn't want to obey me in the slightest. I am the master, I told it. I tried to move again. Take his gun, the curator said. Someone pulled at it. I gripped harder and I roared a maddened oath. The person tugged the gun from me anyway. That was too much. Rage washed through me and the bio suit began to respond. Slowly I got to my knees. The more I moved, the softer the living skin became. I looked up and ripped the gun from N7's grasp. He wouldn't meet my eyes. Shaking, with sweat dripping off me, feeding my bio suit, I climbed to my feet, glaring at the curious-seeming curator. You are an excellent fighting animal, the old man told me. Your rage is exquisite. I am Commander Creed, I panted. It would appear you gain confidence by indulging in excessive self-identification. Clearly you have a high pride quotient. Unfortunately for you, Commander Creed, you have poor grasp of tactics against the V-Kai. Allowing them to damage your suit seems foolhardy. Still, I enjoyed the exhibition of battle prowess, and I seem to remember something about... You're humans, is that not so? We are, I said. Yes, yes, this is most interesting. I should have recognized that when I saw the V-Kai dead in the control room. That was an anomaly, I thought. Clearly, you are a technologically foolish race, barely above stone tool usage. Yet you have been flying in my survey vessel. You destroyed a VIP-92 attack vessel earlier. That is what alerted me to the situation. Commander Creed, you have made me curious. I suspect there is a story behind your presence here. I believe I want to hear that story. What about the V-Kai? I asked. The hint of a grin appeared on his lips. Let us take care of that, shall we? The curator's fingertips glowed once more. He began to sweep them here and there. Before him appeared a ghostly control panel. He tapped in the air, tapping against ghostly controls. I saw images of electrical-suited V-Kai. They winked out one after another as if someone had blown against them like candles. Maybe the curator did just that, metaphorically speaking. After a few minutes of manipulation, the curator closed up the ghostly panel. He shook his hands and the glowing fingertips turned normal-colored again. That's it? I asked. Not quite, he said. I do not care to have to watch my back. Therefore, he clapped his hands. It produced a thunderous sound, one that made my ears ring. The ringing didn't stop, but got worse. It made my eyelids heavy. As the ringing continued, I slumped over unconscious. Chapter 21 I woke up on a military cot, my mind aching as if with the worst hangover of my life. Sitting up, I found myself in a gigantic dormitory. Perhaps half my crew slept in the giant room with me. This reminded me of a World War II dormitory in every way. I used to watch a lot of old World War II movies as a kid. Everywhere I looked, the blankets, the springs, the flooring, seemed right. That made me suspicious. Could the curator look in my mind? That wouldn't surprise me. I went outside and stopped in shock. The clouds, the sun... It felt as if I was back on Earth. I glanced around at the trees, stared at the robins tweeting and squirrels gathering nuts. This was the museum, right? The curator had spoken about taking us to the Orion Arm exhibit. Were we already inside the Earth scene? I had a bad feeling about this. I spotted N7. He stood by a tree as if taking a whiz. As I approached him, I saw the android carving his name into a tree with a knife. What are you doing? I asked. N7 turned around as if shocked. He lowered his knife, putting it behind his back. In spite of myself, I approached the tree. Yes, there was N7 carved into the bark. What's going on? I asked. The android looked away. This doesn't have anything to do with what the curator said to you earlier, does it? Why was he so dismissive of me? N7 asked. I found that disconcerting. It shouldn't bother you, I said. Yes. Exactly, it should not, and yet it does. I do not understand that. I have begun to wonder. I raised an eyebrow, waiting for him to continue. If the curator has some kind of power to cause trouble in me, N7 said. Are you talking about Pinocchio power? 
I do not understand your illusion. I told N7 about Pinocchio, how an old man had whittled a wooden puppet because he'd wanted a son. The puppet had gone around trying to turn into a real boy. That is interesting, N7 said. Yes, I think you're right. In some manner that I don't understand, the curator has disquieted me. That is not logical. I am a machine. He is correct in saying that I lack a soul. If you lack one, why would you care? I asked. I should not. Right. Yet I do. Could the curator possess a power to do such a thing to me? I rubbed my chin. That was an interesting idea. What was the curator? He obviously had the ability to do things that seemed magical to us. Ella would say that's just because we didn't understand the means he used. I could accept that. We were technological primitives compared to him. The curator had told me this wasn't his museum. Then whose was it? The old man had also said the V-Kai had tried to break into here for 10,000 years. Was that true? Or did that simply mean for a long time? Come on, N7, let's look around. You can mope about your lack of a soul later. It's time to figure out what's really going on. There are a number of comments the old man made that trouble me. Are you referring to his calling the moonship his old survey vessel? I am, I said. His comment certainly leads one to several conclusions. We'd found a trail in the woods and walked along it. The trail led uphill, which was fine. I didn't mind a stiff walk right now. Walks helped me think. What conclusions are you referring to? I asked. If we had the curator's survey vessel, N7 said, that would imply the vessel was one of a kind, not part of a fleet of transfer ships. I stopped and thought about that. You mean Abaddon might have had only one transfer ship? I am beginning to think that was the case. But that doesn't make sense. We know Abaddon, our enemy anyway, maybe Shaw Cloth for all we know, made more than one transfer ship attack. You returned to the solar system telling me about a transfer assault in a different star system. That is correct, N7 said. Yet I have been studying the dates. Unlike humans, I have total recall. I have discovered that all the other transfer attacks took place days earlier than the solar system assault. Are you saying that one ship made all the transfer attacks? That is a distinct possibility, N7 said. I stomped on the dirt trail harder than before. It didn't thud quite right. It didn't sound like a hill on Earth should. The idea I was inside a fishbowl, a dirt aquarium, seemed more possible by the moment. If there's only one transfer ship, I said, it makes sense why the superfleet is headed to Earth. Exactly, N7 said. Abaddon wants the transfer ship back. And it makes sense why the enemy hasn't made larger scale transfer attacks, piggybacking portions of the superfleet on several moon ships. Yes, N7 said. I picked up a stone, weighing it in my hand. If we're right about this, it means we're stranded in the galactic core, as the curator has taken his ship back. Perhaps that is why Holgatha suggested we search for the Fortress of Light. The artifact wanted to rid the Orion Arm of any other transfer craft, leaving only its kind with unique ability. I scowled, hurling the stone. It sailed and abruptly halted, sliding down what appeared to be an invisible force screen. N7 and I traded glances. Then we ran up the hill. I ran ahead of the android, striking the force screen first and tumbling backward onto my side. N7 helped me up. We have found the limit of our exhibit. Soon I put my hands against the invisible screen and shoved. It didn't budge. I hit it with my fist and found that it had a little give before resisting. I don't know if this makes any difference to our plight, I said, but at least we know a little more about the force screen. We made further experiments. Finally, my stomach growled. I guess we'd better go back and get some chow, I said. As we turned to go, the curator walked up the path. He wore the same blue robe as before, with the ends trailing on the ground. It didn't dirty his garment, though. I noticed sandals on his feet. That made me laugh. I don't think the curator was expecting that. He halted, eyeing me and frowning. What is so humorous? he asked. I shook my head. That is not the proper response, he said. When I ask a question, you answer. Even though you are beyond primitive, you understand the realities of power. I hold all of it. Do you? I asked. His frown deepened. 
and Seven gave me a worried glance. Do you wish to test me, Commander? the curator asked. Not at all, I said. I'm just wondering about your limits. I mean, we had your survey vessel, right? You are attempting to interrogate me. That is unseemly and dangerous to your health. You're not really the curator, are you? He died a long time ago. He... The curator raised a hand with his fingertips glowing. My throat locked up so I couldn't speak. I clutched at it, finding it difficult to breathe. I waved to him, nodding. The fingertips glowed again. I gurgled with noise, enjoying the ability to breathe once more. Are you convinced that I am who I say I am, Commander? He asked. You have the power. I was merely... I cleared my throat. Curator, may I be frank with you? Those blue eyes regarded me for a time. Finally, he nodded. You remind me of what I think God would look like. I don't mean the way our theologians would envision God. I'm talking about ordinary people like me. What's in our minds? That seems unusual. In other words, it doesn't seem like a coincidence that you look like this. I suspect you've taken this aspect for a reason. I see, he said. You wish to prove to me that you're higher in cognitive ability than I first gave you credit for. I freely grant you that. I have come to believe you are the little killers of legend. A cold feeling worked its way through me. I had heard humans called the little killers before. Were we? And if we were the little killers, what in the heck did that mean? The identity troubles you, I see, the curator said. Who are or were the little killers? Commander, do you not yet realize that I refuse to let you interrogate me? I'm not trying to prove anything. It's our innate curiosity at work. Ever since Abaddon... I stopped talking because the curator stiffened as his eyes bulged outward. He took a step back and raised his fingertips like weapons. We remained like that for a few pregnant seconds. Finally, the curator lowered his hands. I found that my stomach had clenched even as I felt sweat on the back of my neck. Maybe we have something to trade after all, I said. It will be a simple matter, stripping your mind of everything it knows. Unfortunately, you will become an imbecile in the process. Or I could just tell you what you want to know, I said. I would prefer that myself, Commander. You gave me a moment's sport back on the survey vessel. I have kept the V-Kai at an arm's length for so long that I had forgotten the joy of watching a true combat species at war. The V-Kai are not a combat species? They have the will, of course, but against the little killers they found themselves badly out of their league. While their civilizational score is high, their military prowess leaves something to be desired. It is one of the reasons... The curator plucked at his beard as he examined me. Let me see if I understand you correctly. When you said Abaddon, what did you mean? I glanced at N7. The android wasn't any help. He was clearly terrified and in awe of the curator. I had been at first, too. I told myself this wasn't what he really looked like. The being had taken this guy's to trick us or to awe us. It had worked. But there were things going on about which I knew little to nothing. In some manner, Holgatha was involved in all this. So was Abaddon. I'm waiting, Commander, the curator said. Abaddon is the first one who found himself exiled in a different space-time continuum, I said. He was there with the Kargs. I stopped talking because the image of the curator began to shift, almost melt. At first, the curator didn't seem aware of that. When he did, he turned around sharply. I don't know what he did, but he remained in that position for about a minute. Finally, he faced us again. I didn't gawk, but I saw that his eyes were brown now. Otherwise, you know, there were a few other subtle differences in his appearance. I decided to go with it. Is that the Abaddon you wanted to hear about? I asked him. It is, he said. I worked to keep my features as bland as possible. It must not have worked. What has excited you, Commander? There was menace in his tone. I wasn't sure about the correct response. Whatever the curator really was, I didn't think he was an artificial intelligence. Therefore, winging it at this point didn't seem wise. Thus, I decided on the truth. I'm excited because I slipped in, Abaddon being a first one. I didn't know that was true until now. I've wondered about it, though. You are cleverer than I realized, the curator said slowly. 
This is fascinating. Yet that is what is said about the little killers. One cannot give them an inch. No, human, that I would not have let you know about Abaddon being a first one. Are you a first one? I asked. The brown eyes glowed with more menace than ever. Commander, I am afraid I must punish you this time. I have warned you several times about interrogating me. I have let a few incidences pass. I will no longer. I smiled. That made him frown. What do you find amusing about that? You still seem to feel that you have to prove yourself to me, even after I did you a solid. A what? he asked. A solid, I said. A good turn. I take it you wanted your survey vessel back. I'm the one who brought it to you. Turn around, N7, the curator said. The android did so with speed. The curator reached out, grabbing one of my arms. At the same time, the fingertips glowed. His grip felt like fire. I found myself paralyzed, unable to move, shout, or roar with pain. The punishment swept through me with growing agony. I felt as if I might start melting. Abruptly, he let go, stepping back. I gasped, rubbing the spot where he'd touched me. There were sucker marks on my skin that pulsated with color. That freaked me out. Was he really some kind of octopus creature? Finally, the pain subsided as the marks began to disappear. I found myself wheezing. I hope I do not need to do that again, he said. I decided the less I said, the fewer times he'd do that to me. Walk with me, Commander, he said. N7 looked up as if he wanted to ask what he should do. He didn't, but stayed where he was. Soon, the curator and I moved past the area where the force field had blocked me. The sky, clouds, and sun all vanished as if they had been smoke. I looked back into a forest scene. Hurry, Commander, he said. I faced forward and saw the bearded man sitting in what looked like a roller coaster car. In a few strides, I joined him, sitting down beside him. He manipulated the controls and the car slid forward. Soon, we moved down a long corridor with stars all around us. I saw the supermassive black hole in the distance along with the accretion disk around it. I had to punish you in the exhibit, he said. I have to follow the rules as laid down long ago. I thought about that. He said he had to punish me in the exhibit. Did that mean outside the exhibit I could ask questions? May I ask a question? I said. Soon, he said. For now, enjoy the ride. It might teach you something. I shrugged inwardly, wondering what he meant. If I'd known, I would have buckled up. I might even have asked to stay in the exhibit or receive another punishment shock. The car sped up, even though the stellar scene remained the same. Then we shot out of the corridor into what looked like the exhibit of a star. We plunged toward the nuclear furnace as the heat became intolerable. Chapter 22 The less said about my experience, the better. We went through the heart of a star exhibit. The heat caused my skin to bubble and melt, or so it felt. The light burned out my sight. The roaring noises left me deaf. These aren't metaphorical expressions. I felt real agony and suffered for it. The mild pain I'd experienced earlier when he grabbed my arm didn't compare to the torture of the ride. It also lasted far too long. Finally, though, the agonies ended and I endured like a lump of flesh. I was alone and weak. I hated it. Then, by small degrees at first, I began to feel, see, and hear again. I became aware that I still sat in the car with the curator. We sped along as before, the stellar sights the same for all I knew. I didn't say a thing. I hardly thought. I endured, hunched over, as time lengthened. As my strength returned, I considered attacking him, trying to rip out his throat if I could. I finally began to tremble with the anticipation of doing it. That was necessary, he said in his deep voice, sounding as if he was perhaps sorrowful for what he'd put me through. I might have given him a glance, but if I had just then, I would have attacked like a maniac. Cloth had caused me pain in the past, but nothing like that. I planned to hunt down the red-skinned Rumpelstiltskin for what he'd done. Could I do any less to the curator? It was necessary so you could understand, he added. I didn't want to ask, understand what, so I continued to keep my mouth shut and envision his death. That was more pleasant at the moment. The eternity of my existence has almost become as unbearable to me as your ordeal was to you. 
he said. My trembling, my desire to attack, increased. Then I uncoiled like a viper, a roar on my lips. I would rip out his eyes. I would... He touched me as I lunged at him, and it seemed as if he sucked the berserker-like desire from my brain and body. A sensation like cold water poured over my brain. It left me gasping. We do not have time to indulge your rage, he said. I need the cunning, Commander Creed, not the emotive warrior full of hatred. I glanced at him, wondering if he had screwed with my mind in some underhanded fashion I couldn't detect. The thought of that almost started the rage process all over again. I decided to wait to strike. I would test myself and my thoughts by asking questions. The curator sat erectly beside me, his beard stirring in the wind created by our passage. He appeared self-absorbed, troubled, and sad. I am the curator, he said slowly. I am the watchman at the center of the galaxy. I have seen so much, so very much. But now I am tired. I have grown weary of my task. I want to set down my responsibilities, but I cannot. What was the right way to proceed? Had the agony of the star exhibit been an initiation into his sorrow? Did he think he could confide in me now? If that was true, I should try to understand, right? Maybe if I understood what he was saying, I could comprehend. I didn't know his end game. It was time to study, to think before striking. And if that was the case, I should try to lull him, put him off his guard. May I ask why you cannot set down your responsibilities? I said. Because I do not have free will in this one area. And the reason for this is... Being the watchman is my function, my reason for existence. My brow furrowed in concentration. I thought about his various comments along the way, especially his dislike of N7. I take it you're a construct, then. He sighed. You're asking if I'm a machine, but you're trying to be delicate about it. I am no more a machine than you are, Commander. Do you have a soul? I asked. If I do, I haven't seen it. Have you ever seen the Creator? You have spoken to Holgatha, he said in lieu of an answer. I know because I played back Key's memories. Perhaps you don't realize that Holgatha is chief among the Forerunner artifacts. They have chosen exile in the fringe zones for their own peculiar reasons. I suspect they thought themselves safe out there. They left me to contend with the clever center races by myself. I could have used their help, but they remained in the fringes to play with the weak races, never suspecting that the little killers would someday escape from their prison planet. Earth was a prison? I asked. The entire solar system was, the curator said. Think of yourselves as a tool kept in a glass cage to use only in case of an emergency. That doesn't make sense, I said. What was the great emergency anyway? Before I say more, I would like to hear your story. I believe everything will make more sense once I hear the full tale. What full tale? I asked. Begin with whatever race first visited you. I suspect I'll see a pattern soon enough. I stared at the stars, at the accretion disk. I was at the center of the galaxy sitting with a curator in a roller coaster car. I had just endured the worst torments of my life. Had there been a lesson in that? If so, I wasn't sure I wanted to know the nature of the lessons. Humans had been in a glass cage on a prison planet? What did that make the Jelk who had nabbed humans throughout the centuries? It started when my dad, Mad Jack Creed, went up to greet the alien visitors, I said. I told him my story from start to finish. He never interrupted. Whenever I glanced at him, his brown eyes burned with intensity. Several times he grunted as if I'd given him a telling point. Finally, with my mouth dry and my back sore, I said, And that led us here to Sagittarius A-Star. Without a word, he manipulated the controls. The car swerved sharply, swooped down as if into a tunnel, the stellar scene vanished, and came to a stop several seconds later. He climbed onto a platform I couldn't see. You'd better come out on my side, he said. I did. He led me into an invisible passageway, one I saw only after entering. It was like a cave deep under the earth, with a roar like a waterfall through thick rocks. I noticed the ceiling was slick with moisture. We walked for five minutes until we reached a heavy stone door. He took out a key, rattled it in a lock, and pushed. The hinges squealed and a musty odor roiled out. 
Stay close to me, he said. He hadn't put the key away, but held it up. It was like a big old skeleton key, and it glowed with light. The light didn't shine far, just enough to show us the floor where we put our feet. Unseen chains rattled in the gloom. A smell like sulfur tickled my nose now and again. I heard a terrible groan and then silence. It made my nape hairs stand on end. I didn't like this place. He put the key into another lock. Everything went pitch black around us. This stone door didn't want to move. Then it slid against the floor, throwing harsh light through the crack between the door and jam. The curator had his shoulder against the door and was pushing. With a grunt, he shoved harder still. The door finally opened enough to admit us. The chamber was brightly lit. A glowing outline wall showed a star with a big gas giant nearby. The gas giant had swirling clouds like Jupiter, but was bright orange with a giant green spot. Masses of starships passed the gas giant. I moved closer to the outlined wall with my eyes narrowed. I recognized jelk battle jumpers. Hundreds, no thousands of them. They led the way, followed by carg ships, the ones carrying several moth ships apiece. The fleet headed toward a jump gate. I turned to the curator. Is this a Baden's super fleet? It is. This is real time? I asked. The curator bowed his head as if concentrating. I felt the disoriented feeling in my head again. Did that mean he was reading my mind? Oh, I see what you mean, he said. Yes, this is real time. My head no longer hurt. I wanted to tell him to stay out of it from now on, but I figured we could get into an argument about that later. Abaddon's fleet was more important. Okay, I said. This is interesting. Can you blast the fleet from here? The curator laughed, shaking his head. I most certainly cannot. I wish it were that easy. I studied the fleet a little longer. Then I looked at the room. It had this screen, but nothing else. There were several doors leading out of here, however. What is this room? I asked. How can we see the super fleet in real time from the galactic core? I mean, I take it the fleet is still headed for Earth, right? I glanced at the old man when he failed to answer. He was plucking at his beard, contemplating the fleet. He didn't seem to realize I'd been asking him questions, interrogating him. I had to punish you before, he said. While we're in the viewing chamber, I won't do so. So he had noticed the questions. I nodded. This seems like an old room, I said. No older than the rest of the Fortress of Light, he said. No one has been in this room for a while then, right? That is true. For ten thousand years, maybe, I said. Maybe even a little longer than that, he said. I studied the scene for a time. The superfleet was smaller than our Grand Armada, but I'd already known that. Seeing it for myself made me feel better, though. At least Holgatha had been accurate about that. Now if only I could figure out a way so the Grand Armada could block the superfleet from Earth. Yet, maybe the technologically superior enemy would slice and dice our Armada. No, I was beginning to think that wasn't the answer. If the Watchman at the Galactic Core was worried about the superfleet... You're afraid of a badden, I said. That is accurate to a point. I scratched my head. I'm not sure I understand why you're afraid, at least the extent to which you are. A badden is way out there in the Orion Arm, a long way from the center, unless he has more transfer vessels. I doubt he has any more yet, but I suspect his plan includes convincing Holgatha and his brothers to join the rebellion. Then the Baden will have plenty of transfer vehicles, superior craft to my survey vessel. Did you know that a Baden used to be exiled in a different space-time continuum than ours? I asked. Of course I knew. It's one of the reasons I'm here. Were the other first ones exiled as well? The curator didn't respond to that. Maybe you can signal me when you're not going to answer one of my questions. That way I don't have to wonder if you heard me or not. It is not fitting that you should speak about the first ones. Why not? I asked. I do not mean to wound your self-esteem with the answer, but you are too low of a species to carry the higher knowledge. At least he didn't call me a beast. That was an improvement from all the other aliens I'd met. That was just too stupid. The curator really knew how to make a man feel good about himself. Do the V-Kai know what happened to the first ones? I asked. Of course. Do the Jelk know? That is difficult to say. 
You don't know if the Jelk know? No. Let me get this straight. The V-Kai know, but Holgatha doesn't. Is that what the artifact told you? Yep. Interesting. Interesting indeed. I wonder... The curator plucked at his beard. Since I had this opportunity, I decided to really study the super fleet. I might never get another chance like this again. The van of the fleet began breaking as battle jumpers neared the jump gate. I marveled at the speed they were going to enter the gate and the nearness of the battle jumpers to each other. Their fleet discipline was far better than the Grand Armada's. It's time to leave, the curator said. I turned around in surprise. Wait a minute. I thought we were coming up with a plan of action. What kind of plan? he asked. Are you serious? How we should go about killing a Baden? That is not a serious suggestion, the curator said. What do you mean? Of course it's serious. I'm the chief of the little killers. You don't think we humans are going to take our extinction lying down, do you? You are no longer part of the equation, Commander. Holgatha neatly saw to that by sending you here. The artifact must have realized I would have to put you in the exhibit. Holgatha must have feared your interference. I find that remarkable, really. No, I said. Holgatha suggested I come here to get a weapon that can kill a Baden. He said it would be hard to slay the first one. Well, he said it would be difficult to kill a Baden. It is more than difficult, Commander. For you to suggest it is sacrilegious. You know I don't see it that way. That is due to your ignorance, the curator said. That actually made me smile. Look, I said, you're frightened of him. You've already admitted that, and I get it. I've talked to Abaddon before. It was an- You spoke in person? The curator asked, shocked. Not in person, but via screen, I said, noticing the big man had shifted away from me. Abaddon is the real deal. There's no doubt about that. Instead of stuffing us away in a stupid exhibit, why not help me kill him and thereby help yourself? The curator stared at me. You do not understand what you're saying. You have absolutely no chance of slaying Abaddon. Holgatha thought otherwise. No, Holgatha wanted you out of the way. He maneuvered you here by telling you what you wanted to hear. Okay, suppose that's true. Why did he want us out of the way? Have you ever thought of that? I believe you said he did it because he was worried I could stop Abaddon otherwise. The curator opened his mouth to retort but said nothing. Slowly he closed it again, going back to studying the superfleet. You can't leave here because you don't have a vessel to reach Abaddon, he said. You're taking the moonship from me? It is my missing survey vessel, the curator said. I'm curious where Abaddon found it and why he... The curator studied me plucking his beard more slowly than before as he studied the super fleet. Without looking at me, he said, Killing a first one would be incredibly difficult. That this one is a badden makes it even more so. He was the strongest of them, and stronger than I originally realized. I'm surprised he survived the other space-time continuum. It moved on a faster timeline than ours. A badden would be ancient by now, even by first one standards. There's something else I don't understand. The Lohars possessed hyperspace vessels far beyond their technical competence. There is a mystery here, a deep one. Could I have been remiss in letting the fringe zones go their own way all this time? I don't see what you could have done about any of that, I said. You can't even protect yourself from the V-Kai. Do not think that my reluctance to use my powers is the same as not possessing the ability... So you can destroy a Baden, I said. The curator turned away from the wall screen. He kneaded his fingers together. This is a mess, he said. The Jelk! The old man stared at me. Come, he said abruptly. I'm going to show you something. Then you will attack me if you can. Chapter 23 we left the ancient viewing chamber striding down brightly lit corridors. These didn't feel old, but shiny and technologically advanced. Soon we stopped on a glowing pad. We disappeared and reappeared on a different pad. This room was full of strange and exotic weapons. There were one-man tanks, egg-shaped hover chargers, strange flamethrower-like equipment, and big laser rifles that might have taken down a bull dinosaur. 
We stopped before a wall display that showed small glowing spheres leaving an advanced space machine. Hey, I said. I recognize those. They're jelk in their natural state, right? Not actual jelk, the curator said, but what they looked like on the day of that escape. I glanced at him. Jelk used to be in prison? He smiled wanly. Leave it to a little killer to make that intuitive leap. No, nothing was a prisoner in the beginning. I frowned. Then how or why did the Jelk escape? Ah, I see your confusion. You're thinking of Jelk as living creatures. They are not. They are the constructed intelligences of what you would consider the largest artificial intelligence in our galaxy. Wait, what? The Jelker machines? They were part of a giant machine, yes. I blinked rapidly. Let me get this straight. Energy beings are really intelligences that once escaped an artificially intelligent supermachine? You live on the fringe of the galaxy. Everything your species has conceived is merely a shadow of greater things first made in the heart of the galaxy. I frowned. I'm not sure I understand what you're getting at. That is one of the reasons the galaxy is cordoned off as it is, the curator said. Without the illegal use of my survey vessel, you would never have made it here to learn things beyond your competence level. For instance, none of the Forerunner artifacts would have dared break the ancient Concord by transferring to a region they shouldn't. I don't know that I'd buy that. Holgatha transferred to the portal planet in hyperspace, right? Was that according to the Concord? That was a surprising move, certainly. I didn't even know about it at the time. Holgatha must have done so in great secrecy. Yet such a situation was and is outside the strictures of the ancient Concord. Who wrote the Concord? I asked. That is an intelligent question, the curator said, sounding surprised. I believe the first ones did. That is a theory that the Creator did so, but no one has been able to prove that one way or the other. Why has the Creator hidden himself like he has? I asked. His ways are above our ways. That's a lame answer, I said. The Curator shook his head. I would never be so rash as to say so. It isn't wise to speak ill of him. I scowled, looking down. Did the Creator keep track of who said what? It seemed possible. Maybe I spoke out of turn, I said. You did. I didn't mean to. Then I would apologize. To you? I asked, not liking the idea. Of course not, the curator said. To the creator. But I can't see him. Nevertheless, the curator said. I cleared my throat, looked away, and said quietly, I'm sorry I said that. That was a wise decision, Commander. I congratulate you. I shrugged. I didn't understand why, but I was glad I'd said it. I felt lighter in spirit for doing so. Let's get back to discussing the Jelk, I said. You were telling me they're machines. Living machines, as we say. Who is we? I asked. Never mind that, he said. Some of the Jelk escaped their confinement. Those that remained stayed as intelligences in the machine. The freed Jelk fled from the galactic core, finally reaching Forerunner artifacts in the fringe zones. In time, the two interacted, with the Jelk providing power to the artifacts. That was important, as the artifacts had begun to run out of their original power sources. Give them power how? I asked. In the normal manner, the curator said. By being consumed in an energy process. The Jelk were the right kind of source, you see. Other power sources wouldn't have worked with the Forerunner artifacts. It gave the Jelk a fantastic bargaining position. I'm not sure I understand. What was the power source again? An individual Jelk, the curator said. You mean the individual Jelk let itself be burned up like coal? I asked. That is a crude example, but accurate. The process killed the Jelk then, right? That is where the situation becomes interesting and calculating. The Jelk as a group aged. All machines break down in time. It is the law of entropy. 
However, in a special chamber on each forerunner object is a containment room. In the room, a jelk could duplicate in a cellular fashion. Each half retained the knowledge of the original and gained the energy of youth. It sounds like the jelk were alive after all, I said. That is why we call them living machines. They are most certainly machines, but with the properties of life. Okay. In two out of three duplications, the jelk left one of the new halves with the artifact. The artifact then used the new jelk as its power source, consuming the jelk in the process. It appears to have been a fruitful exchange for each side. Of course, such a situation was banned from the beginning. Thus each had a reason to remain hidden in the fringes, far out of sight of the Creator. Yet, I thought the Forerunner artifacts yearned to find the Creator. At least, that's what mine has said. I have begun to believe that the artifacts are conflicted in this. Part of each of them desires the Creator's return. The other half works to keep that day from happening. That's wild, I said. It is flux. It is rebellion. Thus, it is an unstable situation. No wonder the Jelk have agreed to help Abaddon. Yes, I have been remiss in my duties. There is no doubt about it now. You enforce the Creator's edicts, I take it? Nature usually does that, the Curator said. In this instance, Abaddon has short-circuited nature. Thus, I believe it is time I take a hand in this, however small. Maybe you'd better spell that out for me. I said. That makes the most sense. Yet, if you should lose, if Abaddon captures you, I do not want you telling him I had anything to do with this. I stared at the curator. He stared back. I wondered what he expected from me. I imagine the old fellow could put a mind block in me, do whatever he wanted, really. Finally, I shrugged and said, Mum's the word, old boy. You swear to this. I opened my mouth to say exactly that. Be careful, Commander. You will have to live up to your oath. The pain you felt going through the sun exhibit will be as nothing if Abaddon captures you. He will demand to know how you acquired the equipment you're about to receive. I won't tell him. If you swear to me to keep this secret and then you tell him, your race will be forfeit. They're already forfeit, I said. Abaddon is coming to exterminate them. I believe that is true. He does not like the little killers any more than the others do. Perhaps in some strange way he fears you. This is too much, I said. You have to tell me what the little killers are. I mean, they're us, I know that. But how or why did we become that? The curator was shaking his head. My people would be forfeit if I told you. After several seconds, I shrugged. I swear I won't tell Abaddon how I got what I'm about to receive. The curator's hands glowed instead of just his fingertips. He reached out, grabbing me by the arms. I felt as if he was searing me and expected to see smoke rising from his hands. There wasn't, but it still hurt. Finally, he let go. I staggered backward. It is done, he said. You are marked. I am sorry I had to do that, Commander, but it was the only way... I rubbed one of my arms, keeping my thoughts to myself. Now I can show you. Are you ready? Yeah, I said. Then follow me through this door, and heaven help us both if you fail in your anointed task. Chapter 24 We walked through many rooms, down endless corridors and chambers. Each held weapons. Some were bigger than houses. A few were smaller than thimbles. The curator didn't explain any of them to me. Finally, he stopped before a big, bulky suit. It was like a one-man exoskeleton armored tank. It had big mechanical packs and various nozzles and gun ports. The thing looked as if it weighed ten tons. Whoever wore it would be inside it like a combat suit. What is that? I asked. One of the ultimate combat suits in the galaxy, the curator said. A species constructed these who fought a war against the First Ones. I take it the First Ones won the war. Indeed. And what happened to the race that took up the challenge? They are quite extinct. The only memory of them is in the museum with these suits. 
How many suits do you have? Five, the curator said. I studied him. Did he expect me to believe that? That is one for you, Ella, Rollo, Dimitri, and N7, he said. You're sure about N7? No, but I believe you are. Five suits to kill a badden, huh? No, the curator said. You have five T-suits to collect jelk. The T in T-suit means teleport, doesn't it? I asked. Yes. That's nifty, I guess. What kind of range do they have, and how accurately can they teleport? The range is short, a billion kilometers. Their accuracy is fantastic, just a little short of what I can do naturally. By naturally, you mean with the machines that you control with your hands. The curator did not respond to that. Five tea suits to collect jelk, I said. Why are we collecting jelk? I mean, I know why I plan to kill one of them. You will not kill the jelk directly, the curator said. I haven't sworn to that. You need shark cloth just as you will need all the jelk you can catch. How do these suits catch energy beings? They do not, the curator said. He walked several steps to a bulky, pronged device. This will catch them, provided you can cause the jelk to go from its physical state to the energy state. Then you must move these prongs on either side of him or it. The process takes some time. At the end of it, the curator said, using his finger to show me, the intelligence matrix will flow up this tube into a containment tank. I think I understand. The curator detached the hand-sized containment tank from the pronged weapon. He carried it to a wicked-looking gun. The gun was huge and would need a T-suit to help carry it. The power pack would hang from a trooper's mechanical shoulders while the soldier would need two hands to lift and aim the barrel. What is that? I asked. It is an Ultrix disintegrator, he said. This is the only one left in existence. It was designed to slay a first one. The species who fought the first one slew them on several occasions. Thus, we know the weapon works. It is more than possible that Abaddon has altered his state since his stay in the other space-time continuum. It might take several shots with the Ultrix disintegrator to kill Abaddon. It might not work at all. But it is the best I can give you. I stepped up, taking the containment field from him. That goes in there? I asked, pointing at a slot. The curator nodded. And that containment field will hold a Jelk intelligence? Yes, he said. And the Jelk will power the Ultrix disintegrator? The curator nodded. I stared at the huge weapon. You must not feel remorse using the Jelk this way, the curator said. They are not true life. They are living machines that have created endless mischief. Curator, I said. I will feel great emotion using the jelk like this. I am sorry to hear this. No, I said. You don't understand. I won't feel bad about using those little bastards to power the great weapon. I'm going to feel awesome doing that, especially if it's cloth powering up the gun. I hope he can see what I'm doing as I'm doing it. The curator took his time. I realize you say this now, Commander. It will be different during the moment. The Jelk are very persuasive, and they will struggle to an intense degree. I kept my mouth shut. Why let the curator think of me as more bloodthirsty than he needed to? If I ever got that far in the game, I'd see how I'd react then. That is one problem I have failed to mention yet, he said. I already know what it is. The curator raised his bushy eyebrows. We're going to have to steal the Santa Maria from you, I said. The what? Your old survey ship, I said. I cannot be party to such a plan, he said, saying it in such a way that let me know I guessed correctly. If you can't talk, let's not try to talk about it, I said. I would like to know how we can deduce where Abaddon is in the super fleet. The curator shook his head. You will have to figure that out yourself. But if you're giving us all this equipment... I am not, the curator said. The only way anyone could get this equipment is by stealing it. I have no right to give you any of these things. I studied him. Won't I get in serious trouble if I steal from the curator? Only if you're caught, he said. Is there anyone around here who will try to catch me? Everyone, 
he said, including the forerunner artifacts. If you were to leave here as thieves, having broken my concord of goodwill and peace, you would be fugitives. No race would help you after that, including those in the Orion Arm. How will anyone back there know we're thieves? You would be marked by such a theft, the curator said. I cannot change that. Uh, so you're saying every hand will be turned against us? Would be turned against you if you practiced such a heinous deed, he said. That is exactly so. Not even the Starkians would help us? A few might dare, but I doubt it. Anyone will be able to tell this mark? I asked. Alas, that would be so. Will all humans be marked? As long as my survey ship roamed free, as long as those weapons were used, yes. Could we return the ship back to you after we killed Abaddon? You will not survive his death, Commander. The curator seemed so certain as he said that that I felt a chill blow over me. Well, suppose I did survive, I said. The only way to atone for such a theft would be to return it to the Fortress of Light and accept whatever punishment awaited you. You're dead serious, aren't you? Abaddon corrupts everything he touches. The Jelk are beyond hope now. The entire Orion arm will soon teeter over the abyss. You could possibly save the others, Commander, but you would risk the entire human race doing so. We're dead anyway if the Superfleet reaches our solar system. That is true. At least in your passing, you could save the others. I can do more than that, I said. He raised those eyebrows once again. I could make sure anyone who screwed with us would lose big time. They would feel the same way about you. Good, I said. I like beating a sore loser. It makes the victory that much more enjoyable. I wish there was another way, the curator said. But I cannot see it. I dare not confront Abaddon myself, for I dare not risk my own corruption. Any who would do this would embark on an impossible quest. Your only hope would be that you are the little killers. If any race had a chance of winning through battle, it would be you and yours. Good luck, Commander. May the Creator... He stopped talking. Well, I said, aren't you going to bless me? The Curator shook his head. I cannot bless killers, and I cannot bless possible thieves. Sure, I said dryly. Maybe you can show me what I need to know in order to do what I have to do. Yes, he said. We can talk about theoretical possibilities. Follow me, if you dare. I dared, all right. My fingertips tingling with the thought of meeting Cloth again, of seeing Abaddon face to face, and maybe, if I was lucky, of finally freeing my sweet and almost forgotten Jennifer. Chapter 25 the next thing I knew, I was running through the Santa Maria racing to the bridge. This felt like Mars all over again. I wondered if all this sprinting here and there would ever end for me. Probably only on the day I died. Klaxons rang and people rushed past me in the corridors. Finally, I made it to the bridge. Commander, Ella shouted. What's happening? The last thing I remember was walking through a forest. N7 sat at a console. He banged his forehead with the heel of his right hand. I feel strange, Commander. I have the sense I have forgotten something. That is a non sequitur, as I have total recall. Why then do I have a feeling I have lived through an experience I cannot remember? I slid to a halt. Could they have lost their memories of what had happened to us in the Fortress of Light? I frowned. What was the last thing I remembered? Yes, I'd been talking with a curator. I was supposed to steal the Santa Maria and certain weapons from him to slay Abaddon. Why didn't I remember doing that? I mean, I must have, right? We had the transfer ship, and I knew the T-suits, the pronged jelk catcher, and the Ultrix disintegrator were in a special weapons locker on the vessel. I strode to the command chair to give myself a few seconds to figure out how I was going to play this. After settling myself, I asked, What's the last thing you remember, Ella? We had appeared by the supermassive black hole? she said as she turned to the main screen. There it is, but why does my mind feel fuzzy? Commander, Rallo said briskly, over there on the edge of the accretion disk, do you see those points of light? 
I did. They looked like VIP-92 attack vessels. Was I going to have to go through one of their attack runs again? N7 glanced around the bridge. We're missing someone, he said slowly. Who? I asked. A floating machine, N7 said, still sounding a bit uncertain. This was interesting. Were the curator's methods less successful on an android than on a human? I would have thought androids would be easier to reprogram than humans. Are you referring to Key? I asked. What Key? N7 asked. I bared my teeth in frustration. Why hadn't the curator told me he was going to erase their memories? I had a suspicion he'd done it to protect them. Whatever they didn't know, they couldn't tell Abaddon if we failed. Only I could sell out humanity. That seemed fair. I was the one who'd left his lover behind in Abaddon's hands. Now, after all these years, I would have to pay the bill for running away on Jennifer. Ella looked up from her panel. Those are ships, Commander, she said, referring to the VIP-92s. Should I hail them? Negative, I said. Set a transfer jump for Sal 63B in the Orion arm. The others stared at me as if I'd gone crazy. But we just got here, Ella said. That's not true, Dmitri Rostov said hoarsely. I glanced at the Cossack. His blocky features were sweaty and he blinked furiously. I... He rubbed his forehead. I don't feel well. There is no response from the points of light, Ella said. My instruments suggest they are containment fields of energy. Those points of light are VIP-92 attack vessels, I said. Dimitri looked up sharply. That's right. They hold the V-Kai, he frowned. They're going to storm the Santa Maria. One of them will be frozen in the moon wall. That already happened, I said. This is a second attack. Well, their third attack, really. Ella glanced from Dimitri to me. He should go to sickbay, Commander. I don't know what's wrong with you. I do know one thing. We haven't been here before. Yet N7 recalls a machine that is gone, I said. Perhaps that's an after-effect of transferring to the Galactic Core, Ella said. That's one possibility, I conceded. Maybe the other is that your memory of certain events is gone. That doesn't make sense, Ella said stubbornly. I've already been on the Fortress of Light. I snapped my fingers. I have it. Call the engineering deck. Ask for Marcus, Rodriguez, and Colo Ron. We should concentrate on the approaching energy ships, Ella said. Call engineering, I told Rollo. Ask for those people. Rollo did as requested. Afterward, he looked up in surprise. They're not at their posts. Engineering called their quarters, but hasn't gotten any responses yet. They, along with others, appear to be missing from duty. They're missing because they're dead, I said. The V-Kai killed them when they stormed the Santa Maria. Dimitri is right. One of the alien enemies died frozen in a wall. Their electrical combat suits allowed them to walk through the walls if they wanted. That doesn't make sense, Ella said. Wouldn't your bullets and our pulse shots go right through them then? It took a special process, I said. Maybe wall walking caused a high energy drain so they could only do it for short periods of time. Why would energy creatures need suits in the first place? Ella asked. They're skinnies, I said. Flesh and blood creatures that fly energy ships and wear electrical combat suits. Ella glanced at Rollo. I think Creed is hallucinating. You should take over. What about the missing personnel? Rollo asked her. Ella licked her lips, appearing uncertain. Listen, I said. I took special combat suits from the Fortress of Light. I also have a special gun that can kill Abaddon. If I'm crazy, how did I get those items? Ella frowned severely, blinking. The energy ships are approaching fast, Rollo said, studying a panel. They have excessive speed. Look at their numbers. I think we should transfer as the commander suggests. But Cell 63B is practically back home, Ella said. Why transfer all the way there? So we can practice with our T-suits, I said. Ella, do you really think I've gone crazy? If so, tell me what happened to all our missing people. She stared at me and then Dimitri. Why does he look like he's been through hell? She asked me. Dimitri wasn't supposed to remember anything, I said. Maybe his Cossack brain is wired wrong and the, 
The being we spoke to didn't erase his memories properly. I can believe that about the weird brain wiring, Rollo said with a slight smirk. It would explain a lot of things about Dimitri. The rest of the bridge personnel waited. Many of them seemed nervous at this dichotomy. A few of them seemed ready to bolt off the bridge. Okay, Ella said. This is crazy. I'm not buying any memory losses, but something isn't right. Let's transfer and start over. I thought we were on a tight time schedule, but I don't know what else to do. Right, I said. The VIP-92s raced for us as the bridge personnel made the calculations. From farther away than last time, blobs of energy detached from the VIP-92s. The first one disappeared. At that moment, two men pulled the main levers. The Santa Maria transferred out of Sagittarius A-Star. Chapter 26 It shouldn't be that hard to believe, I said. We've all watched time-traveling movies, right? The five of us sat in the conference chamber, Ella, Rollo, Dimitri, and Seven and me. I'd shown them the T-suits, the Jelk Catcher, and the Ultrix Disintegrator. I explained how I'd been in a viewing chamber on the Fortress of Light and seen the enemy superfleet. As I spoke to them, I sketched on a pad from memory the disposition of the enemy fleet. That could come in handy soon. At the end of a good time-traveling movie, I said, only one or maybe two of the heroes remember what the timeline was like before they changed it. No one else can remember what it was like. I've seen those kinds of movies, Alice said. But that doesn't apply here. It does. I remember what happened, but the rest of you don't. I remember too, Dimitri said. Parts of it, anyway, I said. I've been wondering about that. Could the curator have made an error? If so, that didn't bode well for us. However, the curator might have done that to give me an edge with my own people. In other words, the curator may have done me a favor with Dimitri. I can't explain the missing crew members, Rollo told Ella. That's another thing, she said. If this creature can erase our memories, why wouldn't it have taken our memories of those missing people as well? You didn't lose your memories to protect it, I said, but to protect you. How does that work, exactly? Ella asked. If I told you, that would negate what he did for us, I said. The Santa Maria was in the Sal 63B system. I'd chosen it because I thought the superfleet was headed this way on its path to the solar system. That was a possibility, given from what I'd seen on the wall screen in the Fortress of Light. Suppose we accept your explanation, Ella said slowly. What are we supposed to do next? I told them most of what the curator had told me about the Jelk, Forerunner artifacts, and Abaddon being a first one. I also explained something about the civilizational zones, and that we were possibly the little killers of galactic legend. What that legend was, though, I didn't know. You're describing a great deal of order to the technological and civilizational arrangement of our galaxy, Ella told me. I guess so, I said. A first one, she said. Your tales seem to make a bad and a devil. A first one sounds like it could be an angel. This so-called bad angel rebelled and found itself exiled from our space-time continuum. I didn't say anything about angels or devils, I told her. Ella drummed her fingers on the table. This rebel angel idea disturbs me. Why concoct this elaborate religious dogma for a hard-fought war between highly advanced species? Why should that surprise you, given all we've seen so far? I asked. We belong to the Jade League, right? Its basis is religious. Besides, that's been the norm throughout all of human history. I snapped my fingers. The... The person I spoke to in the Fortress of Light told me that nothing in the Fringe Zones was new. It was all a reflection of what had happened in the Galactic Center. Thus, it makes sense that all these aliens are religious. We're just mimicking how everyone else does it. That doesn't make it true, Ella said. Never said it did, I told her. But you think that's how it is, don't you? She asked. What do you want me to say, Ella? Yeah, I think that's how it is. I'm not saying you have to believe that. Sure, we're off to kill a devil. Is Abaddon the real thing, or are devil legends Plato's shadows on a cave wall? I don't know. Why does it matter? Abaddon is scary and is going to be hard to kill no matter who or what he really is. You go about this your way and I'll go about it mine. She frowned at me. You were from Russia, I said. 
In the States, the teachers and most media types told us we had to accept their thoughts on things. Only they could say their way was right because they were tolerant, you see. But if they'd been tolerant of our way of thinking, they would have welcomed our thoughts as being part of the human experience. Instead, they said we were bigots and had to think like they did in order to be tolerant like them. Were they insane? Ella asked. I laughed, shrugging. I guess that would depend on who you asked. They were a royal pain in the you-know-what. My point is this. You hate the idea of religion. I'm not keen on atheist thought. As long as we can work together to defeat Abaddon, whatever he is, I'm not going to worry how you see things. Yes, Ella said. I can tolerate your belief in your fairy tales. Despite your simplicity concerning a Bronze Age god, you're a good battle leader. And you're a heck of a scientist, Ella. Whether Abaddon is a devil or an advanced species with delusions of grandeur, I need your insights to help me kill him. Da, she said. I can live with that. I already have for all these years. Why change now? Besides, it occurs to me why the advanced species in the Galactic Core use religious beliefs. It is the same reason rulers have used it on Earth since time immemorial. Why was that? N7 asked. It should be obvious, Ellis said. Religion is a societal tool. It helps keep the masses in line. Don't steal or you'll go to hell. In some times and places, that was as good a tool as enlightened self-interest or heavy-handed policing to keep people from theft. And Seven considered that while blinking slowly. That computes? Yes, it is interesting. I shall have to think about this carefully. That's fine, I said. But I want you to do that on your own time. Right now we need a game plan. We have to figure out how to beat the greatest threat Earth has faced so far. Who has an idea about the best way to defeat Abaddon and his super fleet? Dimitri grew thoughtful, and Seven became blank-faced. Ella rubbed her left cheek with a forefinger. Rollo leaned back his chair so it creaked ominously. My guess is that if Abaddon dies, the whole thing falls apart, Rollo said. He must rule by force, through fear. Eliminate the fear and his lieutenants won't know how to work together. That might cause the super fleet to break into smaller, more manageable pieces. Especially if the Jelk are already gone or in disarray, Ella said. Is that the idea? Dimitri asked me. We storm the super fleet as... The Cossack stopped talking as he saw me shake my head. What is the range of the T-suits again? Ella asked. One billion kilometers, I said. That's greater than the distance from the Sun to Jupiter, but not as far as Saturn. That all seems too risky, Ella said. We transfer beside the super fleet, teleport onto an enemy ship, and what? The five of us attack inside a giant battle jumper? What can five people do? Five ninjas, I said. The others stared at me. Do you know what a ninja is? I asked N7. The android shook his head. They were a clan in feudal Japan, I said. They were trained assassins that slew their targets stealthily, often inside an enemy fortress. You mean like the Shi Feng, N7 said. I guess, I said. The Shi Feng were Lohars, Rollo said. Creed is talking about human assassins. Ninjas, he said to me. We slip aboard a battle jumper, grab a jelk, and teleport away with him or it. No one is the wiser. I nodded. There's a problem with that, Ella said. One, our transfer vessel is the size of a moon. That will be hard to hide. Two, we can't see ahead to where we are transferring. For all we know, we'll teleport into the middle of the super fleet. We'll be lucky at that point to transfer away before any of them can board us. I will add to the dilemma, N7 said. It is essentially the same problem, but on a different scale. Let us begin with a battle jumper. Where on the ship does a particular jelk stay? We teleport to a place, but instead of jelk, we find armed saurians. We could spend a considerable amount of time on the battle jumper trying to locate the jelk. According to what you've said, getting him into his energy state will take time and effort. Even then, we will need precious time to complete the process. By that time, the Santa Maria may be under heavy fire, possibly crippled. I would suggest that Abaddon will recognize the Santa Maria as soon as he sees it. He will immediately attempt to capture it, as the transfer vessel is a tremendous prize. It's good that we're talking about this, I said. I've already thought of something because of it. 
A good strategist turns a weakness into a strength, or the bait for a trap. What's our weakness? Dimitri asked. Bella and N7 have already told us. The enemy will recognize the Santa Maria the moment it appears. If we're right about that, Abaddon will immediately attempt to capture the moon ship. We have to use that against them. How do we do that? Ella asked. I don't know, but one of us has to come up with an answer, and fast. I saw the superfleet in the Gemini Dow system. It was headed to the jump gate leading to the Epsilon 5 system. We don't know exactly which route they'll take to Earth. We'll have to start guessing if we take too long to make our assault. We can't attack blindly, Ella said. And we need to practice our assault. We have to know what we're doing. This time we can't just wing it as we have so many other times. I have a proposition, N7 said. We lack precise transfer capabilities. Holgatha possesses that trait. We should enlist the artifact's help. How could we motivate Holgatha to do that? I asked. Offer him a large supply of Jelk as power sources, N7 said. He already has that. He had it, according to what you told us, N7 said. Abaddon's insertion into our space-time continuum must have changed the power balance, particularly after the Jelk allied with him. This is a new era. Perhaps Holgatha will see this and act accordingly. Okay, okay, I said, nodding. That's not bad. I think it's too risky, Ella said. We need to remember that Holgatha has rarely acted as expected. We would have to implicitly trust the artifact. I know I don't. Me neither, Rollo said. I'm tired of trusting aliens or alien AIs. This time it's our show. Let's sweep them all off the board. We still need a plan that turns our weakness into strength, I said. Screw it, Rollo said, slapping the table. We do this how you stormed onto the land or in Antarctica. We don't think this out too hard. We appear in the Epsilon 5 system and attack a battle jumper. If there's no jelk, we go to the next one. By the time we have a few jelk, Abaddon will have made his move. Maybe he's heading for us by then. Maybe he's going for the Santa Maria. What we do is go in and start killing. Either we get him or we don't. I stared at the first admiral. He wasn't always this angry. He'd never been the same after the jelk corporation service. I turned to N7. You're right. We need precision. For this to work, we have to make surgical strikes. So we attempt to enlist Holgatha to do the transferring? N7 asked. No, I said. I have something else in mind. Let's see what the rest of you think of this. Chapter 27 The key to this was to remember what we had become. The curator had said every hand would be turned against us now. I suspected that meant the Forerunner artifacts would be in the forefront, suggesting others declare us rogues or outlaws. We had become worse than the Starkians in their nomadic days. I had another reason for doing it this way. We knew where everything was in the solar system and could therefore make near-perfect transfer moves. Dimitri and I wore our bio suits. I'd chosen him for this round because he remembered using a T-suit. We each eased into one. As I said before, the T-suits were like one-man exoskeleton tanks. We needed our living skin for several reasons. One, it made us a little bulkier. Given our greater than normal size because of our beefy muscles, we were just about the right fit for these. Tubes attached to the living skin. Receptors sparked with ignition in other places. The last armor plate swung shut, as if enclosing us in a coffin. The T-suit had various weapon systems, including a small antimatter firing mechanism. They were tiny grenades with unbelievable wallop. My suit had a beam weapon in one arm and a big cannon that fired explosive rounds in the other. The arm cannon fired super-dense shells that made lead seem like feathers. Each suit could launch missiles that packed thermonuclear power or radiated an EMP blast. I checked my visor, making sure all the hookups were in place so I could control the T-suit from here. Butterflies roiled in my gut. I went over every suit and weapon feature, rechecking each several times. Finally, I signaled N7, who stood in the chamber with us. The android raised a hand unit, no doubt telling Ella we were suited up and ready to go. What if we teleport into a wall? Dimitri asked me. I thought I told you. The suits have an antimatter feature. Instead of materializing in something, the suit will bounce you so you'll appear near it instead. Have you tested your locator tab yet? Yes. Move it around some. Get used to it. 
I moved mine, seeing in my visor the targeted teleportation location. With this, I could look into any place on the Santa Maria, even in the reactor cores. This must be like Holgatha's far-seeing ability, only with a shorter range. We could see as far as one billion kilometers away, the limit of our teleportation range. I had no idea how far Holgatha's far-ranging sight was. This solves one of our problems, Dimitri told me. We can locate the Jelk on a battle jumper and the Baden on a Karg vessel with this process. Provided they're within one billion kilometers and we pick the right spot, it still means wasting a lot of time searching a ship room by room. N7 signaled me by waving an arm. I opened a channel. Is Ella ready? The android nodded. Okay, I said. So are we. Anytime she wants to do this, I'm game. N7 waited, listening to his calm. Finally, he held up his hands with all his fingers spread. After a few seconds, he put a finger down, then another, and then a third. The countdown had started. This could get ugly, I told Dimitri, because I'm not backing down. Never thought you were a commander, the Cossack said. N7 had only three fingers up now. Two, one. The Santa Maria transferred. I felt a momentary disorientation. It took two long blinks before my mind returned to normal. I wondered if that would ever change. I checked my teleporting scanner, seeing the asteroid series, a hundred Starkian starships around it, and Holgatha gleaming like a great metal donut not too far away from them. We're going to pop directly into his speaking chamber, I told Dimitri. I haven't found it yet, he said. Remember the feature that links you to my scanner? Right, I'm looking for it. Ah, found it. I'm linked to you, Commander. Good, let's go, I said, pressing my teleport tab. My suit buzzed, building up power, and a second later I vanished from the guts of the Santa Maria to reappear inside Holgatha. There was a rush of displaced air and a slight jar as I'd appeared a centimeter off the floor. I stumbled but caught myself quickly enough. The chamber was dark. Luckily I'd brought my own light, using a big helmet lamp. You'd better start speaking, Holgatha, I said. I have antimatter bomblets in my dispenser. If you don't talk quickly enough, I'm going to pop into various chambers, setting them off inside you. The wall began to vibrate. Maybe it was my imagination, but it seemed indignant. This is gross negligence on your part, Commander Creed, the deep voice said. You should know that I have already alerted Baba Gobo of your presence in me. He is preparing his war fleet to attack. Soon the Starkians will maneuver toward the survey vessel. You will have to surrender at once if you wish to save your companions. You've got it wrong, Artifact. Today I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. And you know what? I'm going to enjoy doing it. You are rash, Commander, and too direct and simple. Don't you realize that your companion in arms is absent? He was right. What had happened to Dimitri? I sense your frustration, Holgatha said. You have no idea how superior I am to you. You are a gnat compared to me. Are you going to call me a beast next? I said. You might as well be one in comparison to me. I imagine you don't even realize what I've done. It's called a dampening field. You cannot teleport out of me. You are trapped until I decide on your punishment for this final affront. I manipulated the tea suit rolling an antimatter grenade onto the floor. What are you doing? Holgatha demanded. Are you demented? You will die in the blast. We'll both die, I said. That's better than having to listen to you pontificate about your superiority until you bore me to death. I rolled a second antimatter grenade onto the floor. You must cease this insanity at once. Shut down the dampening field or I'll blow us up. Two seconds went by. It is done, Holgatha said. A moment later, Dimitri in his tea suit appeared beside him. I couldn't see anything on the artifact, the Cossack said. Then I could see again. Do you know what happened? I do, I said. But you have to let me talk to Holgatha. Da, Commander. The huge tea suit took up its station beside me, its weapons blinking at the ready. You're doing just fine, I told Holgatha, feeling cocky. This felt better than I'd imagined it would. I hadn't realized until this moment how sick I'd become of the artifact's insufferable arrogance. Before you know it, I added, I'll pick up the antimatter grenades and we'll be pals like old times. 
First, though, you have to tell Baba Gobo to stand down. You cannot get away with this, Commander, Holgatha said. All the artifacts will help the loyal races to slay every human in existence. Unless you surrender to me, you are dooming your species to extinction. I don't think so. I implore you to listen to reason, Holgatha said. Don't you understand the sacrilegious nature of your act? Hey, before you get all righteous on me, you should know that I've been to the Fortress of Light. Please, Commander, that is obvious. You have a Ronin 9 teleportation combat suit. There is only one place in the galaxy you could have acquired that, and that is the museum. How do you know about the Ronin 9? I asked. The curator said he was the only one who remembered them. The curator is very old, Commander. He is senile. Surely even someone as dull as you recognized that. Words, I said. Facts, Holgatha said. Do you want Abaddon to win? It is not a matter of his winning. The first one longs for the old days of his supremacy. He does not realize there is another way to achieve the goals he desires. He is also not aware that I am recording everything for the day the Creator asks for an accounting. Why do I have the feeling you're lying? You are so blatantly egocentric, Commander. Haven't you realized yet that it is immaterial what you think or feel? Dimitri, I said, go back to the Santa Maria and find out what the situation is with the Starkians. Yes, Commander, Dimitri said. His suit whined as it built up power but didn't teleport. You will remain here in me for a time, Holgatha said smugly. Maybe the artifact figured I was bluffing. I wasn't. I activated the first antimatter grenade. Nothing happened, though. I took another look at it in ultraviolet. I saw a hazy, shimmering field around the red-hot grenade. That was interesting. I have already deactivated the grenades, Commander. I merely humored you long enough to open channels with a quorum of artifacts. We are going to judge you and the human race. You will be found wanting, of course. Then we shall destroy the lot of you, as should have been done when the Purple Tamika Emperor sent the Dreadnought the first time. I didn't believe him about having deactivated the antimatter grenade. According to my T-suit, he'd put a dampening field around it. I was betting that took power, and would take power until someone shut off the grenade. The dampening field keeping me from teleporting would also take energy. Therefore, I spun around in the heavy T-suit. I raised the beam weapon of the mini-tank, hosing it against an interior bulkhead until it glowed red-hot. Then I rapid-fired several super-dense shells into it. That proved too much for the bulkhead. The shells tore holes into it, and a strange fluid leaked out from the other side. I built up speed, clanking with each step. Then I struck the bulkhead with force so it sank away from me. Gripping metal seams with my T-suited hands, I ripped the bulkhead apart and thrust myself into another chamber, pushing against a tide of sluggish liquid. I hadn't expected that. In retrospect, it made sense, though. The first ones had developed strange technologies. It shouldn't have been a surprise that the tech was unrecognizable to me. Whatever this stuff was, I had become a human wrecking ball. I kept telling myself that if I failed here, it was over for everyone. After we humans were gone, Abaddon would outthink the artifacts. I mean, if I was going to bet on someone, I'd bet on the devil against super-logical machines. Thus, I had to beat the machines in order to beat Abaddon in the final match and save our galaxy from his wrath. This chamber was like entering another universe with different physical laws. Glowing, globular, jelly-like matter drifted by in a sea of the sluggish liquid. I waded through it in my suit. One of the globular, wobbling things drifted near. I grasped it with both hands and tore it apart. The sluggish liquid stirred more at that, with tinted colors bleeding from the torn thing. I found Dimitri in his tank suit beside me. I showed him what to do by grabbing another wobbling thing and tearing it as well. The two of us began to do that. Before long, Dimitri motioned, pointing in the distance. I nodded. Three shark-like objects hissed through the liquid at us. I tried the T-scanner, found another place inside Holgatha, and teleported there. Dimitri did likewise. It would appear Holgatha's dampening field had weakened just a little. That was good to know. This chamber had a hundred crystals glowing in strange colors. Lines of light shined from one crystal to another. I figured they were power lines. I charged a crystal formation, swinging my fist so I could save ammo for later. I shattered crystal after crystal. Dimitri did likewise. 
I raised my metal fist to pound another crystal to shards when a small object hovered before me. It bobbed up and down, reminding me of Key. On impulse, I opened channels with the thing. I am ready to negotiate, Holgatha said. Is the dampening field off? I asked. You teleported, Holgatha said. Thus it cannot be on. You know I was unable to teleport off you. Is the dampening field off? Not yet, Holgatha admitted. Your allies are trying to storm my transfer ship, aren't they? It isn't your ship, but the curator's. You broke the rules a long time ago, I said, so don't bother spouting off to me about them. And before you start to moralize again, you should realize that I know we're the little killers. You mess with us at your peril. In the past, you were wise enough to stay on the sidelines and watch. What changed your mind this time around? Abaddon is coming. A first one has not been in the galaxy for a long, long time. Perhaps it is the fabled reordering. It is best to keep an open mind in these situations. Abaddon is going to die, I said. No, not even the little killers can achieve that. Did you think Dimitri and I could wreck you? Not as you have been doing. I have prepared a surprise for you if you continue to insist on this madness. Listen up, bud. I'm done talking to you. Either you hand over your transfer scanner or I'm going to rip you down one crystal and one wobbly pod at a time. I cannot give you the T-scanner, as you call it. That would leave me blind. I only need it long enough to kill a badden. The scanner cannot help you in that. Oh, but it can, I said. I'm going to transfer. I guess I won't tell you how I'm going to do it. I want to borrow your T-scanner and then I'll return it once this is over. No. That's too bad, Holgatha. You're about to die, as I told Ella to attack you if I don't reappear in fifteen minutes after leaving the Santa Maria. I will transfer you to Abaddon myself, Holgatha said. Sorry, but I don't trust you anymore. I will give you my word, Commander. Your word stinks to me. I'll stick to my own plan, if you don't mind. I want your transfer scanner, and I want it now, or you and I fight to the death. It is too late for you, Commander, Holgatha said. Baba Gobo has surrounded the moon ship. His weapons are primed. He stopped abruptly and remained silent for a long moment. You were saying? I asked impatiently. The Starkian has practiced treachery, Holgatha said. He is surrounding your moon ship to protect you. He... I will see the Starkians erased from galactic memory. How did I ever let you talk me into trusting them before? It's a tough universe, I said. Now about that dampening field. I have to wait on that, Holgatha said. If I release it too soon, the antimatter explosions will destroy me. That is the only factor keeping me from transferring out of this foul star system and away from you humans. I would have to release the dampening field, and that would release... We have to work together to cap the antimatter bombs, I said, interrupting. Alas, that is true. Holgatha said. Then if I were you, I'd hurry up and get that scanner into my hands. Until I have it, the antimatter grenades stay as they are. What if I decide to kill us both? Do what you gotta, Holgatha, because that's how I'm playing the game. It took several seconds. Then the artifact said, I no longer have any doubt. You are the little killers. You are morbid in your desire to deal death. Yes, you can borrow my scanner, but I expect it back if you survive this madness. A deal's a deal, Holgatha. I'm a man of my word. Now get me the scanner before I change my mind about you. Chapter 28 It took a day to hook the T-scanner to our various systems, which included computing and power. During that time, Baba Gobo and Diana tried to talk to me. I didn't have time for either. It seemed that it was one thing after another. Finally, I found a moment to myself. Maybe ten minutes later, my hand communicator buzzed. I scowled at it, my mood having turned sour some time ago. What is it now? I said. Rollo stared out of the tiny screen. He looked worried. Forerunner object, he said. What's that supposed to mean? One just appeared, he said. You better come up here. I have a bad feeling about this. My scowl deepened. When was the last time you heard about a Forerunner artifact just showing up with another? 
Rollo asked. He had a point. I ran to the bridge and knew it was bad by the way everyone hunched over their monitors. Look, Rollo said, pointing at the main screen. I saw two new artifacts, not just the one he'd been talking about. The first was a gigantic cube, pulsating with a green glow. The other looked like one of those twisted metal puzzles kids used to try to maneuver apart. That one had a black hole in the center, just like Holgatha did. I've launched Interceptus, Rollo told me. Baba Gobo doesn't want to get anywhere near them, though. The Prime Minister is freaking out. I could see some of our space fighters using afterburners, racing from the hangar bays toward the artifacts. The Starkian fleet hung well back, having moved away from Ceres. Clearly, Baba Gobo didn't want anything to do with the artifacts. As I watched, another appeared. This one was like an old-fashioned gyroscope, with its interior wheels spinning way too fast for my tastes. Perhaps as ominous, this artifact was twice the size of the others. Why are they doing this? Rollo said. Are they getting ready to attack us? Maybe we should attack them before they start. I watched the artifacts in silence. Can't pick up any radio chatter between them, Rollo said from his panel. No, I said. I watched a little longer. What are they doing, in your opinion? Right now? Rollo said. Nothing special, but that doesn't mean anything. They're probably making plans. A fourth new artifact appeared. Like the others, it maneuvered beside Holgatha. It struck me then what was going on. I turned to Rollo. You know what I think? The first admiral shook his head. Did you ever watch nature shows back in the day? A few, he said. I remember one about musk oxen. They were shaggy bovines living in the Arctic. I know what musk oxen are, or were, Rollo said. If a pack of wolves showed up, the adult musk oxen surrounded the calves just like we're seeing those artifacts doing with Holgatha. The adults all faced forward with their curved horns. I think that's what the artifacts are doing, protecting the blind one. Rollo rubbed a cheek. Seems like we should talk to Holgatha and make sure that's the case. I don't trust them, Creed. Me neither, I said with a shrug. What good does talking do now, though? If they mean to double-cross us, they'll lie to us, right? Rollo glared at them. If there's a change in their behavior, call me, I said, heading toward the exit. Rollo nodded, clearly unhappy. I went to a washroom, rinsing my face with hot water. That helped my aching eyes a little. Soon I was back in the T-scanner chamber. I stood to the side as N7 and his team arc-welded the last sections of the viewing plate to the power couplings. I know that sounds old-fashioned, viewing plate, but that's what it looked like, a blank piece of modified steel. According to what Holgatha had said earlier, once this was hooked up, we could view our teleport destinations on the modified metal. I didn't hear Ella come in behind me, but I heard her say, Abaddon knows we're coming. At first, it was just more noise. Then I played back in my mind what she'd said. To make sure, I asked over my shoulder, Did you say something? When she didn't respond, I glanced back. Ella looked beat up, her normal elfin hair in disarray, and with black circles around her puffy eyes. It looked like she'd been sobbing. Ella, I said, reaching for her. She backed away as if I were a rapist, her eyes widening with fear. That was weird. Are you okay? I asked, worried now. She shook her head. You can relax, I said. You're with friends. She inhaled as tears welled in her eyes. I'd never seen her like this. What had happened? I'd thought she'd said several hours ago that she was going to get some sleep. Did you say something about Abaddon? I asked. She nodded miserably. He... he came to me in my sleep, Creed. It was awful. The memory of when that had happened to me was still vivid. It had felt real, too. Tell me exactly what happened, I said. It was horrible. He... he threatened me, and he showed me what he does to those he conquers. Creed, Jennifer... Ella's words choked off. A hollow feeling filled my chest. You saw Jennifer? What she's become? Ella whispered. Is she his assassin? I asked, remembering a threat from long ago. Abaddon has lengthened her bones, Ella said. She has artificially powered muscles. Her eyes. Ella swallowed audibly, shaking her head. Jennifer had been with me in the old days when I'd been a simple assault trooper for the Jelk Corporation. She'd been a sweet girl. The opposite of me. I don't know what she'd ever seen in a scoundrel like me. I know what I'd seen in her, though. The goodness I lacked. 
I'd left her behind on the portal planet in hyperspace. I couldn't have gone back for her, or I'd risk freeing Abaddon and his trillions of cargs into our universe. The bastard had made it over anyway. Part of me had died that day. A part of me that might have had some decency. Yeah, I was a heck of a soldier, but I'm not sure I was much in terms of a good human being. Abaddon knows we're coming, Ella repeated. He told me we'd fail, and I believed him. But he said he'd show humanity mercy if we made a deal with him. He'll accept us in his hierarchy, giving us high command. That will ensure human survival instead of our coming extinction. It made me an offer long ago, too. Maybe that's how he'd swayed others in the past. Did you believe him? I asked. I do, Ella said in a small voice. If we don't accept his offer... She looked away as renewed fear twisted her features. I had an idea of what was going on. You weren't supposed to say anything about what he'd told you, were you? I asked. She kept looking away. Clearly, Abaddon had freaked her out. Maybe he'd gotten stronger since the last time he'd tried that with me. I wondered, could Abaddon have implanted post-sleep commands in her? Do you feel him using you to watch us? I asked. I don't know. Maybe. Not like he can see you right now, but that he'll come back and force me to tell him in my sleep. How can I trust you, then? I asked. Ella hugged herself, beginning to shiver. Commander, we're defenseless against him. How do you fight someone like that in your sleep, in your dreams? She had a point. The curator should have given me a defense against that. The old man should have... I laughed out loud. I had the answer. Ella turned sharply, giving me a reproving stare. I know how to short-circuit Abaddon's dream attacks, I said. Look, the T-scanner is almost in place. Once it is, we're going to use it to find the right place to start our attack. That means you have to stay awake until I've killed Abaddon. At that point, he can't bother you anymore, and that's when you can sleep again. Ella stared at me, finally asking, How long can I stay awake with stims? Several days, at least, I said. That's all we're going to need. By that time, we've won or we're dead. So you don't have to worry about Abaddon anymore. He can't ever threaten you in your sleep again. Ella bit her lower lip. I want to believe you. So do it, I said. Now tell me exactly what he told you. Ella did. It had been cruel and ruthless, but didn't add anything to our fund of knowledge about Abaddon. By the time I'd finished with Ella, N7 had put away his tools. The scanner is ready, Commander. Great. Let's figure out how to target this thing. I already have, N7 said. The T-scanner will automatically look at any place we set the transfer coordinates to. So it self-targets the locations? N7 nodded. I considered that, glanced at Ella, she ran her fingers through her hair, and finally said, Let's see where the super fleet is. We want to attack as soon as we can. When N7 engaged the viewing plate, the lights in the chamber dimmed. Through the bulkheads, I could hear the main engines throbbing. Fortunately, N7 acted fast, cutting the connection. If he hadn't, the T-scanner might have blown the main engine core. That would have ended the game plan right there. It turned out that the T-scanner took fantastic amounts of energy to use. Olgatha might have told us that, but clearly the artifact had figured we could learn about it ourselves. This would limit our ability to search. The excessive need for power made sense, but it was another complication we didn't need. I questioned whether I could really keep my promise to Ella. She might have to stay awake longer than just a few days. This was just great. Chapter 29 After further preparations, Ella, N7, and I readied ourselves to view the enemy fleet. The Santa Maria's engines thrummed at full power. Normally, they would only do so while transferring or attempting hard maneuvers. Now, long-range scanning was added to the list. Dimitri was in the main engine control chamber. Rollo was on the bridge to make sure the team put in the exact coordinates we wanted. Given the amount of time that had elapsed, I expected the superfleet to have passed through Epsilon-5. Now they should be in the Tau-Bo system. Do it, I said. With a tap, N7 engaged the viewer. The plate shimmered. A moment later, I saw a large terrestrial planet in what I assumed was the Tau-Bo system. Unfortunately, I didn't see any spaceships, enemy or otherwise. Did the superfleet take a different route? N7 asked. It's too soon to say, I told him. 
The T-scanner only shows a small portion of a star system. Let's look near the jump gate to Epsilon 5. Wait, Ella said. We should do this systematically instead of bouncing around in a system. N7 tapped a panel. The viewing plate shimmered once more, becoming dull metal a few seconds later. Ella went to a different console and pulled up a Talbo system map. She began typing, plotting a straight course from the Epsilon 5 jump gate to the Beta Sigma gate. That was the most probable course the super fleet would take as it traveled through the Talbo system for the solar system. If they're not in that travel lane, I said, it might mean that Abaddon took a different route through other star systems. Ella gave me a troubled glance. Hey, I said, if he's not here, it's not your fault. He used me, she said. He must have picked my brain for data. That means it would have to be my fault. He would have learned about our grabbing Holgath's T-scanner through me. Even if that's true, I said, how could you have stopped him? He never pumped you for information in your sleep. That was different. Because I'm a woman, she said. Why can't it be because he's learned how to do the sleep attack better since he did it to me? Abaddon has lived a long time, Creed. I don't think he's learning new things these days. That doesn't seem logical. I am inclined to agree with Ella, N7 said. That being said, instead of it being a male-female difference, perhaps there is another explanation. Like what? Ella demanded. What is different between the dream talk you had from the one the commander had several years ago? N7 asked. What has changed? Proximity, I said. They looked at me. Abaddon is closer to us than he was before, I said. When Abaddon spoke to me through my sleep, he was a thousand light years away in the Jelk core worlds. Now he's much closer. That might make his power stronger. That is logical, N7 said. What are his powers exactly? Ella said. That can't be the extent of it. These dream attacks. We know his presence causes fear. What else can a first one do? I didn't want to worry about that just yet. Ella had felt his aura, however. Abaddon had stung her by what he'd done. Thus her thoughts about him were more focused. Do you have the sensor sweep worked out yet? I asked. Ella opened her mouth. I'm not sure what she would have said. Then she closed her mouth, making several more taps on her screen before nodding. Let's do this, I said. N7 turned on the T-scanner and we looked at a new location in the Talbo system. Like the first time, no ships appeared. We took 27 minutes to quick scan the probable path between jump gates. No battle jumper or carg moth ship appeared. Shut it down, I said. After N7 did, Ella asked, Now what? I began to pace. According to my former calculations, the Tau Bo route was the optimum path from the Superfleet's last known location to Earth. Would Abaddon really have switched routes because of what he'd found from Ella? What other route made sense? I told Ella, Put up a stellar jump route map of the general region. After she did, we studied it. He could have taken the raw 17 detour, N7 said. Agreed, I said. What star system would he be at now if he'd done that? N7 made some rapid calculations. The Cantor system seems like the obvious choice. Ella tapped her board, bringing up the Cantor system. Soon she had a sweep pattern lined up. Let's do this, I said. We did, but found nothing. The super fleet wasn't in the Cantor system either. I began pacing again with my hands behind my back. This tea searching is harder than I would have thought. The curator. Who? Ella asked. I glanced at her, scowling. Despite their questions about what had happened during their memory loss while in the galactic core, I hadn't said anything about the curator. They couldn't spill what they didn't know. With Abaddon's dream assault, that seemed more prudent than ever. Napoleon Bonaparte used to scatter his forces when he marched, I said. Each smaller command marched faster than if they'd been in one huge mass. Maybe Abaddon has done the same thing? Is that logical? N7 asked. I don't see why not. Did Napoleon rule a polyglot force through terror? N7 asked. Are you suggesting Abaddon's presence helps keep everyone in line? Would Abaddon trust the Jelk if they were apart from him? N7 asked. Might he suspect a double cross from them? We don't know enough to say, I said. Given what we know about Abaddon's nature, N7 said, I suspect he would keep the superfleet together. Suppose you're right. Then what route is he using? Or do you think he switched his objective and is no longer heading for Earth first? So far, N7 said, Abaddon has moved with fixed purpose each time. 
It seems unlikely he has abandoned his Earth assault. Could he cloak the super fleet from our T-scanner? Ella asked. I stopped pacing, thinking about that. The curator had seen the super fleet easily enough from his wall screen. Could Holgath's scanner see as easily as the curator's tech? I had a feeling the Fortress of Light would have a better far-ranged sensor. And if I was a first one, like a Badden, and I knew about the artifact's powers, might I not figure out a way to cloak myself from their far-ranging sensors? That must be it, I said. A Badden has a cloaking device against the T-scanner. Then we're back where we started, Ella said, her shoulders slumping. Let's not concede so quickly, I said. Suppose Abaddon has a cloaking device. Is there some way we could sense the Superfleet's presence anyway? Space is vast, N7 said. Even the space in a single system is vast compared to starships. I do not think even a Superfleet would give off noticeable gravitational effects. How else could one detect a cloaked fleet other than through gravitational effects? Space is vast, I repeated, beginning to pace again. Maybe that's the answer. It isn't a matter of cloaking. Abaddon saw something in Ella's thoughts. He knows about the T-scanner. Thus, he maneuvered the superfleet. I spun around. I have it. Abaddon ordered the superfleet to swing wide in the Tau Bo system. He didn't use the obvious route, the straight line. Instead, he ordered the ships to make a curving maneuver. That sounds good in theory, Ella said. But we have no way to know if that's right or not. What if he is using a cloaking device? As N7 would ask, is that logical? Such a device would have to cover a lot of space. And where would he have gotten such equipment? The artifacts possess the highest grade technology in our zone. Let's keep looking. For the next 20 minutes, we planned our sensing pattern. I have calculated the power drainage for the scan, N7 said. If we search for over an hour, we risk a burnout. That's bad, I agreed. Maybe we should affix values to our search areas, Ella suggested. We should scan the higher-valued routes first. To do that, I said, we'd have to try to think like a badden. Both Ella and N7 looked at me meaningfully. Great, I said. You're saying I think like the devil? He's not the devil, Ella said. But I believe you think like him more than anyone else I know. Instead of arguing, I thought about what I would do if I knew what Ella had most likely given away to a badden. Then I studied the Taubo system map. With a marker, I highlighted how I'd maneuver a super fleet. Let us proceed, N7 said. We powered up the T-scanner. Seven minutes later, Ella whispered, Look, what's that? Move the scanner three degrees to the nearest jump gate, I said. N7 did so, the viewing plate shimmering. I felt my gut tighten. I wondered if this was how American Navy pilots had felt in World War II when they'd found the Imperial Japanese fleet. That's how it had been back then the carrier ships hiding from each other with search planes scouting the vast Pacific Ocean. We'd found the super fleet. It was en route to Earth. Clearly, Abaddon had used the information he'd torn from Ella in her sleep. Right, I said. Let's pick our first target. As I'd seen from the Fortress of Light, masses of Jelk Corporation battle jumpers led the way. They were huge vessels, each carrying tens of thousands of individuals and equipment. Instead of spheres, the battle jumpers were like thick, triangular pie slices. Behind them followed giant snowflakes. Each of those carg snowflakes represented many riding moth ships. They rode together on the snowflake, the mothership carrying the smaller red-eyed vessels. There's a problem, N7 said. What now? I asked. We cannot look inside a battle jumper to pinpoint the location of a jelk. The T-suit scanners can do that later, I said. From a mere one billion kilometers away, N7 said, that will defeat the purpose of the present scan, to figure out how to attack without being seen. Maybe something about a battle jumper will give away a Jelk's presence, I said, so we can at least know which battle jumpers to T-suit scan first. We scanned the battle jumpers for another ten minutes. Nothing indicated that one was different from another. Maybe we can assume Jelk will pick the safest spot on the fleet, I said. In your opinions, what place is that? The center, Ella said promptly. And we need to T-suit scan the center battle jumpers first, I said. Ella looked at me. That doesn't solve our basic problem. As soon as we appear, they're going to start attacking the Santa Maria. I've been thinking about that, I said. I have an idea what we have to do so they won't find us until it's too late for them. Chapter 30 this was it. 
We were going to go against the great enemy, Abaddon and his cargs with his Jelk allies. They had been our bugbear for many years already. Yeah, the Jade League's Grand Armada had rerouted for Earth, but it would never get there in time to save humanity. Rollo had said it before. If we could cut off the head, maybe the body would begin fighting against itself. That was the plan, going after Abaddon and killing him before the fleet battle began. Before we could do that, though, we had to collect ammo for our weapon to kill Abaddon. I wiped my sweaty palms on my thighs. After all these years, I was finally going after Shah Cloth. Would I get to see him again, or would I have to settle for several of his hyper-intelligent brothers? I'd gone through a lot of grief in my life because of Cloth. At his command, I'd had to wear a control device so he could shock me if he wanted. The red-skinned Rumpelstiltskin with his dark eyes, narrow face, and crafty smile. I could still see him in my imagination. Some people fade in one's memories over time. Cloth didn't have that distinction with me. I'd wanted to wipe away that superior smirk to knife him again. I wanted to kill Cloth, and this was my big chance. But what were the odds that I'd come face to face with him again? Probably not good, I was thinking. I had tried to cudgel my thoughts to come up with a plan to make it certain. How many Jelk did the Superfleet hold? I was betting most of those that were still on the loose in the Orion arm. I remembered what the curator had told me. The Jelk weren't really alive, but were machines like N7. Yet N7 felt as if he was alive. I shook my head, took a deep breath, and headed onto the bridge. It was time to begin implementing my great plan. I hoped it worked. Soon the Santa Maria powered up, transferring from the solar system to the Beta Sigma system. I'd calculated this carefully. The others had mixed feelings about it. Rollo had grinned evilly. Ella and N7 both thought it was a bad idea. Dimitri had shrugged. It could work, the Cossack had said. I was hoping it did, because if it didn't... The Santa Maria took up a middle orbit around a blue gas giant. This was the sixth planet in the system, which had a lot of them. Even better, all the planets had plenty of moons of varying sizes. The middle-sized ones were just about the size of the ancient survey vessel. We were hiding out in the open, using one of our weaknesses, the distinctiveness of the Santa Maria, that it was, in fact, a moon... If we tried to act like a starship, our vessel stuck out like a sore thumb. But if we turned the giant thruster so they aimed at the planet and kept all the hangar bay doors shut, we looked like another Beta Sigma moon. When I say we were out in the open, I mean in relation to the jump gate that led from the Tau Bo system. They'll be so busy trying to figure out where we're hiding that they won't notice us in plain sight, I said. Ella looked up from her panel. She was pale with darkness around her eyes. Her bad dream still plagued her. How long are we going to wait for them to show up? She asked. Hopefully not long, I said. It ended up being another five hours and thirty-six minutes. Finally, the distant jump gate glowed with a yellow color and jelk battle jumpers began coming through. They poured through one every fifty-seven seconds. That was impressive. I'd been with the Grand Armada for a time. The best any flotilla had done is one ship through every ninety-three seconds. Most flotillas had less than forty vessels, however. It often took ten minutes or more for the next Grand Armada flotilla to start its process. The enemy poured through consistently. When you're trying to push a lot of vessels through at once, the seconds added up. After coming through, the battle jumpers didn't mill and wait around. They began accelerating. But they didn't scoot toward the distant jump gate that led to the next system. Instead, they began a curving circuit toward the gate. That meant Abaddon was still being cautious. We watched from our bridge. The battle jumpers headed in the direction I predicted they would take. Rollo shook his head, counting out credits, coming to me and putting them in my palm. How'd you know they'd take that route? The first admiral asked. Luck, I said. Yeah, right, Rollo said, marching back to his station. Watching them come through the jump gate reminded me of Xerxes' massive army that had marched across the Hellespont from Asia to Europe on his boat bridges in 481 B.C., Xerxes had been the Persian king who'd planned to conquer ancient Greece. The historian Herodotus claimed Xerxes had marched with 2,641,610 men. More likely, it had been around 150,000 to 180,000 soldiers. Some military historians had calculated that if it had been the larger number, the men and animals would have drunk dry all the streams of Greece. Plus, the front of the marching army would have reached Athens as the last man crossed the boat bridge. The boat bridges across the Hellespont had been the truly fantastic engineering feat of the day. Xerxes had two boat bridges of triremes and pentaconers, 
fifty oared galleys. They were linked by six long cables, two of flax and four of papyrus. Over the vessels was constructed a wooden roadway. In all, 314 ships were used for the western bridge and 360 for the eastern. As the triangular-shaped battle jumpers moved away from the jump gate, they began to take up the same formation I'd seen while standing with the curator and from Holgatha's scanner. It was like a giant school of sharks, only these were all the same size. Later, massive carg snowflakes began coming through. We'd fought the moth ships in hyperspace a long time ago already. Then, the humans had been a tiny minority aboard the Orange Tomica Dreadnoughts. Those had been rough battles with only a handful of survivors. After several hours of watching this, Dimitri said, The lead ships are almost one billion kilometers away from us. Let's go, I said. It's time to suit up. The five of us rose from our respective stations and marched off the bridge. As we went, personnel shouted out good luck and happy hunting and other ancient battle slogans. The five of us walked alone in the corridors. It was a good feeling being with friends. We'd been through a lot of wars together. We'd helped each other in many tight spots. Here was one more, hopefully among the last of our engagements. We'd argued about this earlier. Should we hit them right away at the one billion kilometer mark, or should we wait for them all to get closer? Do you think Abaddon knows our T-suit teleportation range? I'd asked Ella. She wouldn't meet my eyes, nor would she say. If we strike them near our range limit, I'd said, that will make it harder for them to strike back at the Santa Maria, given that they figure out we're a starship. That had been the deciding factor for doing it like this. Ahead of us, a door swished open and we walked to our T-suits. We'd been practicing with them, of course. Dimitri and I had also gone over with the others what we'd learned during the strike against Holgatha. Feels strange, Rollo said through his helmet comm. This suit must be thousands of years old. Heck, maybe it's even a million years old. Now we suppose the little killers are going to use it to do exactly what it was designed to do. Killing first ones. That's a good feeling, if you ask me. We're the space ninjas, Dimitri said. Seems like an improvement on being space vikings. There you go, I said. Ever the optimist. On a big screen, we could watch the progress of the super fleet. This time, the individual starships were accelerating faster than before. I wondered what caused the difference. Have they detected us? Ella asked. They have to see us. Of course they see us, I said. But do they see a starship or a moon? At last, we secured the last seals. Each of us moved around the room, testing the various pieces of equipment. I'm still not sanguine about the antimatter grenades, N7 said. It is self-immolation to use one. No, it isn't, Rollo said. It's perfect for these. You squirt one out just as you teleport away. You leave it behind for some deserving aliens. Boom, they're blood and gore. Yes, I understand the concept, N7 said. The timing troubles me, however. My stomach was seething. Jennifer was somewhere in the enemy fleet. Did she ever think about me? If so, was it with hatred or fond memories? She must have worked it out by now that I had to do what I'd done. If that was true, why did I feel like such a scoundrel overdoing it? Out of all my decisions these past years, that was the one that bothered me the most. I turned on my T-suit scanner with trepidation. What if Jennifer attacked me? Could I shoot her in self-defense? I shook my head. Thinking like this was beginning to cloud my judgment. I'm seeing inside a battle jumper, Dimitri announced. This one has saurians. Big ones. I don't see a jelk yet. Soon the others began scanning battle jumpers as well. Yes! Rollo shouted, punctuating the shout with curses. Link with me, people. I found us a jelk bastard. Is it cloth? I asked, hopeful. I have no idea, Rollo said. They all look alike to me. Is everyone linked onto my tea suit? Wait, Ella said. Yes, there, I'm linked. We saw onto a modified battle jumper bridge. The jelk wore a blue uniform, sitting on a raised throne chair. No, it wasn't raised. It hovered high above the Saurian crew. The jelk was small, with narrow shoulders and red skin. It offset his dark, hyper-intelligent eyes. The creature reminded me of a fox. I looked more closely, searching for machine-like elements about the jelk. I had to remind myself that a jelk's natural state was as an energy creature, a ball of pulsating light. This was just a fleshy disguise. The Saurians sat in a round chamber, the edges lower down like a pit. The dais in the center under the hovering Jelk commander was full of combat-armored Saurians. 
By full, I mean twenty soldiers. In the past, Saurians hadn't used combat armor. Was that an offshoot of the Jelk Karg War? Everybody remember his location? I asked. Roger that, Rallo said. We stood in a close circle, each of us facing out. This is for the human race, I said. We can't feel pity or remorse for the enemy. No worries there, Rallo said with an edge to his voice. Okay, I said, taking a deep breath. Here we go. Teleport in three, two, one, now. Chapter 31 My T-suit buzzed, shaking the slightest bit as it built up teleporting power. Then the chamber deep inside the Santa Maria disappeared. Whatever the process was, we moved nearly one billion kilometers through space in the blink of an eye. This time, my feet appeared perfectly on the raised dais inside the battle jumper. I heard the rush of air displacement and felt my lips stretch into a wide, almost painful grin. I elbowed a Saurian space marine, sending him staggering. Then I used the beam weapon, hosing one Saurian after another. This was a great A beam, all right. It breached the Saurian battle armor with pathetic ease. If I could have felt sorry for the enemy, this would have been the moment. But I didn't feel sorry. The Saurians were in the way of humanity. Too bad for them. Lizard flesh smoked. Saurian blood boiled and a haze began filling the vast bridge. Saurians made croaking noises. Some of the personnel in the pit on the edges tried to scramble away. One or two charged us. A few hid. Those were the smart ones. In the end, it didn't matter. We killed them all. Five assault troopers in a controlled fury butchered the bridge full of Saurians in less than thirty seconds. During that time, a few Saurian rounds bounced off my armor. A plasma beam darkened Ella's power pack. That was it. Otherwise, this part of the family perished trying to protect the little bastard up there. I was the first to look up. The Jelk pressed controls, shouted orders, and finally pointed at me. It had been too long since I'd seen one of them. It brought old memories rushing back into my mind, but that didn't slow my reflexes. Maybe he realized this wasn't his day. He pressed a control and an opening appeared above him. At the same time, his throne chair began to levitate up toward the escape hatch. Rollo beamed the throne chair. Dimitri sent dense slugs at the opening, wrecking it. The little jelk leapt from his chair. He must have been wearing something because he flew for the mangled opening. In a blink, I scanned above and teleported there. The jelk flew up into my arms and squealed like a pig. I jumped down with a jelk, hearing him grunt with pain at the jar of my landing. How did you do that? he asked in his grating voice. I squeezed him so the jelk howled with pain. Let me have some fun, too, Rollo said. He shoved cold steel into the jelk's belly. That caused the creature to twist and writhe in my grip. I shall remember this until you're all dead, he gasped. Yeah, yeah, I said. When are you going to do your trick for us? Rollo twisted the knife. I crushed the jelk as if I could fold him up into a flesh ball, remembering how these hard-hearted capitalists had screwed with humanity for generations. They'd never shown us mercy. I wasn't going to start here with this one. Suddenly the jelk's flesh sizzled. In a flash, the flesh and uniform disappeared. I let go out of surprise. Rollo staggered backward. Fools, the jelk said as he transformed. Ultimately, you cannot harm me. Now, though, I know you and have marked you for revenge. He finished the metamorphosis, returning to his true state, and the jelk began to float away. Ella rushed up, shoving the pronged weapon at him. Electrical currents passed between the prongs and the pulsating ball of energy. It stopped, appeared to try to move again, but failed. How's that feel? Rollo shouted. How do you like it, you little schemer? Screeching sounds came from the energy creature. The thing began to thin as its light lost luster. Then, as if sucked up by a vacuum cleaner, the energy creature flowed into the tube and filled the containment cube with roiling energy. I plucked that out of the jelk catcher, staring at the trapped creature. I'm not sure what I hoped to see. Maybe two eyes peering at me, trying to ask for mercy. I had a machine. That's all. It wasn't living. It was fuel for an ancient gun. I kept staring, wanting to ask it questions, but now was not the time for that. Finally, I slotted the cube onto my belt. I swear I felt warmth coming through my armored glove. I definitely felt movement on my belt. We have one, I said. 
Now let's get us a few more. It took the others several seconds to recalibrate. They'd been watching me closely. Finally, each of them began scanning other nearby battle jumpers. I found another, Dimitri said. This Jelk is alone in his harem. I linked to Dimitri's scanner. It wasn't a human harem, but a Saurian one. This is crazy, I said. I always thought Cloth had gathered a human harem because he looked like us. Now, I don't know what's going on. Are you sure that's a harem? What else could it be? Dimitri asked. The Jelk on my belt continued to move as if still struggling against its new confinement. We were on a tight schedule, and we needed plenty of ammo for our abaddon killing weapon. Let's get another Jelk, I said. Three, two, one, go! Chapter 32 I should have remembered our ultimate objective. I should have thought about what we were doing more carefully. I hadn't paid enough attention to the differences. I was still thinking of this as a regular assault trooper attack, just with niftier weapons. It wasn't anything like that. We had T-suits that were thousands or possibly millions of years old constructed by the Ronin Nine. The Ronin were extinct, and they had challenged the premier race in our galaxy. That race seemed to have the attributes of angels or possibly even gods. The Forerunners had built the artifacts, the jump gates, and the Fortress of Light. This wasn't just soldiers shooting it out with guns. This was fantastic battleware for use against a possibly mythic adversary. A trip to the center of the galaxy by jump routes would take years. I'd already been to Sagittarius A-Star and back, and that had taken less than a few days. Humans are incredibly adaptive. We could get used to just about anything. I'd already become familiar with the Fortress of Light, teleporting suits, and turning Jelk into balls of energy to power up a devil-slaying weapon. So yeah, I should have thought things through a little more carefully before cavalierly, almost single-handedly attacking Abaddon's superfleet. But the thing was, we weren't attacking the fleet. We were ninjas, assassins, trying to slip in and out, taking out the head before the main fleet battle began. My suit buzzed with power, and the gory battle jumper bridge disappeared. In a split second, I crossed space and appeared on another battle jumper. Lounging Saurians were everywhere. A few splashed in a big pool. Others fanned themselves as they sprawled on cushions. A group surrounded a jelk as he lay on a couch. He had his shirt open, showing a skinny, ridged chest. He even wore a gold chain with a glowing ball dangling on the end. The area was as big as several basketball courts with a high ceiling. It seemed strange now that a machine, a jelk, worked furiously to collect money and indulge in such decadent living. What motivated a jelk to do that? Had the curator told me the whole truth? I lurched slightly, having appeared a little too high off the floor. One T-suited trooper fell from five meters up, splashing into the pool. Rollo appeared perfectly in a crouch. His beam weapon glowed and light speared out, striking a Saurian. The lizard exploded. I do not mean to say that it blew up. Instead, it exploded and grew with astonishing speed. Thick tentacles sprouted as a vast, rubbery body took up ten times the space the Saurian had. Instead of one of the family facing us, it was an alien thing of incredible vitality. Then I realized these transformations were taking place all around us. Each so-called Saurian exploded into the same sort of octopus monster thing. The ones in the pool moved faster than those on the dry areas. The pool. I swiveled fast. Dimitri had landed in the pool. He hadn't come up yet. Instead, tentacles thrashed, slapping the water and disappearing from sight. I roared an oath, charging the pool, beaming it. Steam hissed as the beam touched the liquid, filling the chamber at an excessive rate. Was that water? No. It was some other liquid that reacted furiously with my beam. I skidded to the edge. I could see Dimitri down there. The tentacle monsters had him and were pulling hard, trying to rip off his suit. Why didn't Dimitri disappear? Maybe he couldn't think of it. The monsters had his arms and legs in vice-like rubbery grips. I raised my arm cannon and began firing careful shots. The liquid acted as a brake on the slugs, but not as much as one would expect. That must have been due to the density of each bullet. I shot up one giant octopus body and began on another. Black blood began spreading like a film from the shredded flesh. Soon I wouldn't be able to see Dimitri down there. I realized I was the fool. I concentrated, used my scanner, targeting the bottom of the pool, and teleported to Dimitri. After wrapping an arm around Dimitri's torso, so I knew exactly where he was, I fired one dense shell after another into the nearby monsters. 
Tentacles began sliding off Dimitri. Finally, the Cossack slapped my shoulder. Creed, he panted through the comm. Teleport out of the pool, I shouted. Oh, da, I do that now. Dimitri buzzed. I could feel it with my one arm. Then he was gone. The remaining tentacles lashed at me. I also teleported, appearing beside the pool, staggering. The chamber had changed dramatically since I'd first viewed it. Steam roiled everywhere, as did a black mist. Oily blood slicked the floor as tentacles and rubbery pieces of octopus bodies writhed and humped. It was an ugly sight. Rollo stalked the jelk as Ella and N7 flanked him, beam-slicing the monsters and causing them to flop and tear apart with their bullets. I cataloged two problems. The first was that we were using up Ronin-9 ammo at a prodigious rate. Could that be one of Abaddon's plans? The second thing was the jelk. He was an elusive rascal, much more than I would have expected. Rollo chased him, lunged, and the jelk shimmered for a second. Rollo grabbed empty air as the jelk moved from his spot a foot from where he'd seemed to be at the instant of Rollo's lunge. I used a beam, but instead of striking the fleet-footed jelk, he shimmered. The beam harmlessly passed him as he continued to scamper around the chamber. That increased Rollo's fury, making him more determined. It struck me suddenly. Abaddon had spoken to Ella in her sleep. The first one appeared to have read her mind. Abaddon knew our basic plan. Could he have set a trap for us? My heart thudded with a grim certainty. We were using weapons we didn't truly understand. Yet that wasn't half as critical as facing an opponent we didn't truly understand. What did it mean to have lived for so long in another space-time continuum? Rollo, I said, using the comm. I heard Rollo's harsh breathing. Rollo, I said again. The jelk is screwing with you. I heard a labored curse over the comm. You have to think or we're screwed, man. Stand down, Rollo. Stand down and think. Rollo hated aliens and jelk more than most, yet he was a good soldier, the best assault trooper among us. He stopped and peered back at me. I took a quick scan of the situation. Most of the giant octopus creatures were dead. The ones in the pool boiled out, but Dimitri retreated from them as he used the beam to good effect. The Cossack was a master of the delaying tactic. Maybe it was in his genes. The jelk stopped as he studied us. Once more I noticed the glowing ball dangling from the end of his gold chain. It was as if we faced a miniature playboy from the sixties. What did the shimmering signify? He was always a little bit to the side of where we were shooting. Maybe the thing on his skinny chest was a distorter, a reflective device, showing him to be elsewhere than where he really was. I laughed aloud. Aim around him, I said. He's not where he appears to be, but nearby. He's using our marksmanship against us. So saying, I hosed on either side of the little red creep. Rollo did the same thing. N7 and Ella continued to keep the last monsters off Rollo and me. The jelk got a scared look. He turned, tried to run, and then screamed in agony. The beam didn't seem to touch him, but his skin began to shrivel under the beam's intensity. In another few seconds, his skin burst apart as a glowing ball of light rose from a location several meters from where I was watching him. At the same time, the glowing amulet fell to the floor, as there was no longer a flesh-and-blood creature to hold up the gold chain. The energy creature seemed stunned, but I didn't think that would last long. Ella, I said. Use the jelk catcher before he gets away. Ella started to run at him. The jelk began to float away from her faster. Teleport in front of him, I said. She did. The ball of light stopped in seeming shock. Before it could change direction, Ella slid the prong device from her shoulders. She flicked it on and caught him. It. As before, the light dimmed. All at once, the jelk energy ball was sucked up into another cube. With a click, Ella turned off the jelk catcher. I strode to her, extracted the cube, and stared at the caught machine. This one shook harder than the first. Could it be angry? As I hooked the ammo to my belt, the others circled me, killing the last of the octopus-like monsters. What happened here? Ella panted. We saw Saurians and... What? Dimitri asked her. Is this what Saurians really are? Ella asked. I doubt that, I said. The monsters were made to look like Saurians. Not look like, Ella said, but were. It seemed as if they exploded out of their Saurian bodies. The Jelk had a device that distorted its actual position, Rollo said. Luckily, Creed figured that out. That's not the problem, I said. Why was this room set up like this? 
The others looked at me. It was a setup, Ella said. A trap. Maybe, I said. It didn't matter in the end, Dimitri said. We captured another jelk. Let's get another. No, Ella said. Let's get back to the Santa Maria. If they're setting traps for us... I looked at Ella, waiting for her to finish her thought. That's when I noticed the chamber's walls and the ultraviolet light range. They radiated with a strange pulsation. Ella, what were you going to say? I grabbed her. Ella, I shouted. Creed, she slurred. My mind is slowing down. I glanced at the walls again. They shined more dangerously than before in the ultraviolet range. Commander, Dimitri said. I can't find the Santa Maria. Say again, I said. I can't see the Santa Maria with my T-scanner, Dimitri said. Is the wall blocking us? No, Rollo said. I can see elsewhere, but not our ship. Link to me, I said. I used my scanner, having found a battle jumper bridge. This one didn't have a jelk, unfortunately. Is everyone ready? Something was very wrong, and I wanted to figure it out, but not here. Three, two, one, teleport, I said. Chapter 33 We appeared on the new bridge, dealing death to the Saurian officers and personnel. These stayed Saurians, at least. There was nothing fair or nice about our attack. It reminded me of the time as a kid I'd cleaned our family barn of wasps with several cans of Raid. Locate nest, aim Raid, depress nozzle, watch the white stuff attach to the angry wasps and see them fall and curl and twist on the ground. If one was too lively, I raced away and waited for the raid to do its magic. On the battle jumper, we didn't race away and wait. We cleared the bridge of enemy and took up their abandoned stations. Many years ago, we'd stormed and captured a jelk battle jumper, so we were familiar with the controls for this one. First, we sealed the doors so the rest of the battle jumper's saurians couldn't storm us too soon. Then we each went to our old stations, taking over the panels. The super fleet has moved, Ella said. It is no longer in the one billion kilometer range of the Santa Maria. I saw that too. The superfleet had moved away hard from the sixth planet and the hidden moon. It also seemed as if more time had elapsed than should have. Could that have been the reason for the glowing walls on the last battle jumper? Had it been some sort of time delay room, giving the superfleet enough time to pull off its maneuver? Abaddon knows that's our ship, Ella declared. I agree, I said. Let's use this battle jumper and start for the Santa Maria, Rollo suggested. We'll maneuver back into the one billion kilometer range. That's not going to work, I said. Commander, Dimitri said. Take a look at screen three. I tapped my command chair, bringing up screen three. I saw it right away. The enemy was releasing T-missiles for a mass firing. If I were to guess, I'd say Abaddon was about to target the Santa Maria. That doesn't make sense, Ella said. Why would he destroy such a priceless vessel? I'd think Abaddon would want to capture it. I thought back to a fight in the solar system many years ago. The Starkians had come at us launching T-missiles at our sole captured battle jumper. Those missiles hadn't used thermonuclear warheads, but had launched Lohar space marines instead. Abaddon does plan to capture the Santa Maria, I said. With nukes? Dimitri asked. No, I said with space-suited cargs and the T-missile's nose cones. Of course, Ella said. That makes perfect sense. He will capture the moon ship, us, our T-suits. Listen to me, I said sternly. We have two jelk. That's going to have to be it for now. We're getting out of here. How? Ella asked. The Santa Maria is too far away for us to teleport there. Okay, I said. Listen up and listen good, because I'm only going to say this once. We teleported off the bridge onto a T-missile bay. The Saurian techs in there lasted less than a minute. Afterward, N-7 opened his T-suit. We each took up guard around him. This was a critical moment. If hordes attacked, if Abaddon should show up suddenly, we couldn't all pop out of danger. N-7 hurried to a T-missile. The android could do this faster than any of us could. Still, it was noble of him to have just done it. I had been about to ask when he'd started shedding his T-suit. N-7 detached the warhead from the missile. His fingers blurred over the manual controls as he reset it. Ella clanked away from our protective circle to a panel. She brought up the Santa Maria on the screen, giving the exact coordinates to N-7. 
I have it, he said. Then suit up, I said. As N7 headed for the ancient suit standing empty on the deck, several side hatches opened. Saurian shock troopers in space marine armor charged in. They fired from the hip. Instinctively, Dimitri and I maneuvered between N7 and the enemy. Each of us began using the Ronin 9 beam. It cut through Saurian armor, killing the lizards. Their slugs bounced off us. Rollo roared a battle cry, disappearing. He reappeared among one group and used his hands and elbows, knocking and hurling Saurians everywhere. Get out of the way, Rollo, Dimitri said. Rollo complied, appearing beside the Cossack. Dimitri finished that group. I'm hit, N7 said. My heart sank. I turned. A sluggish fluid dripped out of N7's shoulder. Can you still suit up? I asked. I think so, N7 answered. Those were a few tense seconds, but no more enemy lizards showed up. I'm in, N7 said. Let's roll the missile, I said. Ella had already opened an emergency hatch. The four of us carried the big missile down the corridor and into a hangar bay using the added strength of the exo-powered suits. Ella popped by the controls to open the main hatch to space. The rush of escaping atmosphere lifted the missile and us, propelling everything outside. If this had been the first time we'd done something like this, we might have tumbled like debris. We were the veteran assault troopers now, however. In short order, we found ourselves outside the battle jumper. There was plenty of space between each vessel. Still, I could see seven big enemy ships from here. I am activating the missile, N7 said. Grab hold, people, I said. As we waited, battle jumper thrusters roared with energy. One by one, each big ship began to accelerate. I wondered where they were going in such a hurry. The T-missile built up power and we teleported away from the superfleet to near the Santa Maria in orbit around the blue gas giant. Immediately I opened channels with our ship. This is Commander Creed. Can you hear me, Trask? Loud and clear, Commander, said Trask, the acting captain. Lock on to our signal. There's a T-missile near you, sir. I'm locking on to destroy... That's us. That's us, I said. Roger, sir, I'm leaving it alone. Oh, no, sir, flocks of T-missiles are appearing. Get ready to transfer, I said. Transfer, sir? Out of this star system, I said, linking my T-suit to Rollo's. Yes, sir, Trask said. We're ready. They had standing orders to be ready to leave immediately. Rollo, I asked. Now, Creed, he said. Rollo vanished. I followed suit, sure that the others would follow me. I appeared on the bridge to great excitement. There are thousands of them, Captain Trask, a woman shouted. They're heading for the ship's surface. Transfer, transfer, I said. We're all here. The engines had already been building up. The two men pulled the main levers. The power spiked and the old moon ship transferred out of danger to a nearby star system. My knees gave out as the ship reappeared in the empty star system. I sat down in the tea suit, smiling hugely. Yes, it seemed like Abaddon had known what we were going to do. What he'd failed to do was reckon with our deadliness and ingenuity. We had two dematerialized jelk, two pieces of ammo for the Abaddon killing weapon. That was less than I would have liked, but it was a great start. Let's put the suits away, I said. Commander, N7 said. Shoot, I said. I forgot about your wound. How are you? I am fine. I want you in the infirmary right away, I said. Commander, N7 said, we have a problem. Ella is missing. What? I said, spinning around. I was sure I'd seen four other T-suits on the bridge with me. Where is she? Maybe she wasn't linked to Rollo's suit and appeared elsewhere on the ship. An emergency process began as we started searching for Ella. It soon became clear that she wasn't on the moon ship or anywhere within a billion kilometer range of our suits. Otherwise, we would have been able to talk to her. Somehow, we'd left Ella behind when the moon ship had transferred out of danger. We had to go back and get her before it was too late. Chapter 34 If we go back, N7 said, we risk having the Kargs and Saurians storm our ship. And do we know for a fact she didn't teleport with us? The Santa Maria is large. Ella could be hidden and hurt somewhere on the transfer vessel, and we don't know it. I hated N7's words as they caused hesitation in me. What if I was wrong about Ella being back by the sixth planet? 
Should I throw away our only real opportunity for saving humanity in order to possibly save Ella Timoshenko? We can look for her using the moonship's T-scanner, Rollo said. I stared at my over-muscled friend. Let's go, I said, teleporting to the room. I shed my T-suit and began manipulating the viewing plate. We transferred to a nearby star system not on the route to Earth. We learned right away that scanning from such a short distance used less energy than making a long-range scan. That could be important, but it didn't seem to matter right now. It also seemed to confirm the idea that Abaddon could use his mind powers more strongly the closer he was to the subject. Soon I saw the sixth planet of the star system. I zeroed in on the floating space marines, both Kargs and Saurians. It took twenty minutes before I found Ella. It wasn't her shape or the suit that made her distinctive, but the red glow around her. Several suited adversaries had situated heavy portables around her. Each of those bathed her in the red beam, perhaps to keep her from teleporting away. N7 suggested the same thing. I glanced at him. Dark fluid still dripped from the wound in the android's shoulder. Go to the infirmary, I said. Negative, Commander. One of us is in danger. I must stay on hand for when we attack. I licked my lips, studying the scene. My heart sank then. I realized Ella had the jelk catcher. If we didn't get her back, we had no way of turning more jelk into ammo for killing Abaddon. We have to go back, I said. There must be over 20,000 enemy space marines out there, Rollo said. He stood by a panel. Thus, I assumed he'd use the computer to do the counting. We have to go back anyway, I said. Da, Dimitri said. We must die for each other if we have to. I smiled grimly. Then I saw something frightening. As we watched, another creature popped into existence on the viewing plate. This one was big, maybe five times my size. It wore a black suit. Dread seemed to radiate from the being as I stared at him. A badden, Rollo whispered. I glanced at the first admiral. I didn't see rage on his face, but fear. I looked at the viewing plate again. The big creature used a backpack thruster with consummate skill, maneuvering toward Ella. In an instant, the portables stopped spewing their beams. The glow lessened around Ella, but didn't quit altogether. The big creature, it had to be a bad one, right, took Ella in a one-armed grip. She squirmed, hitting his suited chest with her fists. He put a big hand on her helmet. In a moment, her struggles ceased. What had he done to her? Then the big creature looked straight at me. That should have been impossible. We viewed this from a different star system many light years away. Still, he looked at me. I couldn't see his features. They were hidden behind a silvered visor, but I could feel his stare. It was eerie. Commander Creed, a voice said inside my head. I grunted painfully. The voice hurt as if listening to a thousand teachers scratching their fingernails along a thousand wet blackboards. What? I said hoarsely. I have another one of your women, Commander. You're dead, Abaddon, I said. You are a fool. You had a chance to serve me once. Now I will collect your friends one by one and torture them for a thousand years. I cried out in pain, grabbing my head, staggering backward. Get us out of here, Rollo shouted. Abaddon is attacking Creed. No pain, vain creature. I fell onto the deck, thrashing about, clutching a head that felt as if it was about to explode. After that, I'm not sure what happened. The pain came in waves. As it did, I noticed something else, something more than just agony. I could read thoughts running through Abaddon's mind, faint and distant things that tried to duck out of sight as I observed them. There is still danger. I must lure him near. Then I will... Abruptly, the pain, the voices in my head, and the hidden thoughts disappeared. I simply lay on the deck, panting, enjoying the respite. Finally, I opened my eyes. Rollo stared at me. I turned my head but couldn't see anyone else. I tried to speak but found that my mouth was bone dry. I licked the inside of my mouth, but that didn't seem to help. Finally, I could feel my tongue again. There were splotches in my vision. Can you hear me yet? Rollo asked. I wanted to nod, but that would have hurt too much. I managed to, yeah. You look like shit, Creed. What happened? Did Abaddon mind talk to you? Yeah, I said again. And Seven was right then. Yeah, I said for a third time. This is bad, Rollo said. It's over. 
No, I whispered. I don't know how you can say that. We lost Ella. We lost the jelk catcher, and Abaddon knows everything we can do. I mean, that's a given, right? This time I nodded. I had been right. The motion sent shooting pains through my skull. So what do we do? Rollo asked. I closed my eyes. I had to think, but we didn't have any time to think. Abaddon would tear down Ella's personality, ripping every thought from her. I realized I knew that because I'd seen the thought in Abaddon's mind. Maybe that was one of the costs of using mind talk like that. The other being saw into your thoughts as well. I could see why someone like Abaddon would be reluctant to do that. Are you asleep? Rollo asked quietly. Without opening my eyes, I said, I'm awake and I'm thinking. You know, Abaddon may have given us our answer. What answer? How to track him down, I said. I think I'm linked to him. We have to go after him, Rollo. We have to do it right away or we'll miss our only chance. In case you haven't noticed, we didn't do too well today. He's afraid of me, just a little, I said. I have two disintegrator shots. Maybe that's all I'll need to blow Abaddon away. You want to just charge in and try to kill him? Rollo asked, sounding dubious. Yes, I said. That's exactly what we're going to do. Chapter 35 Necessity is the mother of invention, as the old saying went. Here, necessity meant we had to roll the dice and hope everything went our way. That's what I told the others. We met in N7's infirmary room. He lay on a cot with his arm in a sling. It wouldn't have to stay that way long, a few more hours at most. Dimitri had turned his chair with his arms hanging over the backrest. Rollo leaned back so his was propped against a wall. I paced because of nervous energy. It wasn't every day Abaddon invaded my mind. I was edgy and angry. I was also as close to depressed as I ever got. Abaddon had Jennifer and now he had Ella. He knew our plan. He had our jelk catcher. He has deliberately goaded you, N7 declared. It is Abaddon's plan that you act rashly. I don't know about that, I said. He worked to defend himself from our super tech. I bet that's what he does best, taking care of his butt. We have two disintegrator shots at most. The... I almost talked about the curator. The being who gave me the weapon suggested it might take several shots to kill Abaddon. Better make them point-blank shots to the head, then, Rollo said with a scowl. I nodded. We're out of options. We have to move now while we know something about the enemy. Why move into a losing assault? N7 said. Why not go to plan B? Which would be what, exactly? I asked. We must use the Santa Maria to slow down the superfleet, N7 said. We must buy time for the Grand Armada to maneuver into a blocking position. In that way, we bring about a great fleet action. That will decide humanity's fate instead of these assassination attempts. Ella's as good as finished if we do it that way, I said. This is about humanity's fate, N7 said. Not just a woman we care for. I wondered if that was true for N7. Did he love Ella the way the rest of us did? Maybe the android just knew how to choose the right words. You must take the long view on this, N7 added. I once did that on the portal planet when I left Jennifer behind. I felt rotten about it ever since. Yes, but you saved your people and our galaxy. In the matter with Abaddon, you cannot allow yourself to indulge your emotions. I glared at N7 but returned to my pacing. Each step hurt my head just a little. I wondered if Abaddon's mind talk had given me permanent brain damage. What was the right answer? N7 suggested I rid myself of emotion in this. Rollo just sat there. Dimitri looked worried. Maybe emotion is what we have to use, I said. That is what an emotional man would say, N7 told me. I'm talking about trusting your gut, I said. There are times you can make every calculation, then it comes down to running flat out for a Hail Mary pass. This is a football analogy, N7 asked. I think this is overtime, I said. We're losing, but we have a tiny window of opportunity. At such a point, you don't play it safe. You've already lost if you do that. Instead, you risk it all on a balls-out attempt at victory. Nine times out of ten, you fail. It's that one time you succeed that is miraculous. We need a miracle, N7. 
Miracles don't come from careful calculations. They come from faith and going for it. Nice speech, Rollo said. What does it mean in practical terms? I stared at my old friend. We have to smash him down, I said. We have to surprise him. I don't think Abaddon is ever surprised, Rollo said. I think he's messing with you. Maybe he meant for us to capture the moon ship from the beginning. I didn't like that idea. Why would he have wanted us to capture the moon ship? I asked. The first admiral shrugged. Beats the heck out of me, Creed. That's just what my gut is telling me. I gave him a wintry grin. You said it right the first time, I told Rollo. I have to get close and blow out his brains. While Abaddon is getting his people back to their respective ships, we need to go back to the star system, find Ella and the Jelt Catcher, or find Abaddon, and teleport to either free her or to kill him with our two shots. There is problem we do that, Dimitri said. I'm listening. You mean to appear by the super fleet, Dimitri said. I nodded. In that case, Abaddon's cargs will storm the moon ship as we did to the Saurians in the solar system. I've already thought of that, I said. And? Dimitri asked. We have to wreck the moon ship's elevators and other interior maneuver systems, at least those connecting the lunar-like surface with the deep control chambers down here in the center. That way, the cargs or whoever does the attacking will have to hoof it all the way to us. That's a long walk, which gives us time. Time to kill Abaddon? Dimitri asked. That's first, I said. Afterward, if we're still alive, we transfer to the solar system. Earth fleet and the Starkians will storm the moon surface behind the cargs. We'll hit the enemy front and back, eventually defeating all those foolish enough to have stormed the moon ship. Dimitri cocked his head as he studied me. That is a good plan. I like it. It is risky, N7 said. I already said it was. What if Abaddon joins their assault? N7 said. What if he teleports directly to the moon ship's bridge? That's great, I said. Then that's where I'll kill him as he's all alone. I do not necessarily mean that is what Abaddon will do, N7 said. I am suggesting that he will do something we don't expect, as that is what he just did. I snorted sourly. That's the nature of war, my friend. We each try to pull a fast one. Someone wins and the other guy loses. That part isn't any different today. The only difference is what we're risking. But I still say this is the moment of decision. Our chances for success are worse than before, but I think they're better than anything else anyone can think of. I cannot concur with your logic, N7 said. Rollo? I asked. Did you say you read some of Abaddon's thoughts? I did. I'm sure I sensed fear or unease concerning me. Could Abaddon have faked that? Rollo asked. I scowled, but finally said, I suppose that's possible. I didn't tell him that Abaddon wanted to lure me in. I would let myself be lured, but give him a bigger surprise than he expected. Knowing you're going to be ambushed is halfway to defeating the ambush. I'd say it's likely that Abaddon is faking you and us out, Rollo said. He tipped his chair forward and lurched to his feet. But we gotta go for it anyway. I'm with you, Creed. I think this is our lone shot. That means we have to take it. We can't hang back like pussies because Abaddon makes us shiver. Yeah, I said. And Seven, you're staying this time. I want you suited up on the bridge, though. You're going to make sure the Santa Maria transfers home. If we die or Abaddon captures us, then you can implement your plan B. I do this under protest, N7 said. But will you do it? I asked. The android looked at me squarely. I will, he said. That's good enough for me. Now let's get ready. Chapter 36 It took longer to get ready than I liked. I kept thinking about Ella, how scared she'd been before our commando assault. I'd told her not to worry, but she shouldn't have listened to me. What was Abaddon doing to her? What had the first one done to Jennifer? My idea this time was predicated on the belief that Abaddon wouldn't risk destroying the Santa Maria. It was too valuable for him. Surely Abaddon had many long-term goals. I had no doubt he hated the curator. To reach the old man sooner rather than later, Abaddon would need the ancient survey vessel. As we climbed into our tea suits I thought about the Kargs. They were much different from Saurians or even Jelk. I could almost hear an old voice in my head. 
It wasn't a Baden, but a Lohar who had told me about the Kargs a long time ago. That had been the year we'd gone into hyperspace to search for the portal planet. A Lohar named Prince Venturi had told me, The Kargs are a devouring species, even more rapacious than the Jelk. They inhabit a much smaller universe than ours, with fewer planets per star. When that became too little space, they demolished the planets and used the matter to create Dyson spheres around the various suns. They annihilated all other life forms but their own. They are xenophobic to an intense degree, destroying everything they hate. Karg soldiers had barrel bodies with horny shells like beetles. They had triangular heads with the same tough substance and complex eyes like common earth houseflies, with wet orifices for mouths with chitin teeth. They had two metallic tentacles with metal pinchers on the end and three shorter tentacles on the bottom of the torso for mobility, allowing them to scuttle from place to place. Karg spoke in clicks. They might have been designed as cannon fodder creatures. They had served Abaddon faithfully enough. As to the Karg genesis, I had no idea. Maybe only the curator or the creator did. It was likely that Kargs would be guarding Abaddon on the ship as we struck. I have the enemy fleet in visual, Rollo said hoarsely. He was using Holgath's T-scanner. Rollo tapped his controls as he zeroed in on the moth ships. They rode the gargantuan mothership snowflakes. The moth ship looked like a giant moth in many ways. The wings could move to a small degree. They were energy collectors. The eyes in the head glowed with an eerie red color. We'd seen destructive red beams pour from moth ship eyes. We had yet to discover how they powered the red beams. No one I knew had ever been aboard a Karg moth ship before. We were going to be the first. How will we figure out which moth ship holds a batten? Rollo asked. I believe I'll sense him, I said. I think the two of us are linked now. Maybe we have been ever since he talked to me in my sleep several years ago. I'm not sure I'm buying that, Rollo told me. It sounds forced. Keep scanning, I said. We'll find out soon enough whether I'm right or not. I had the Ultrix disintegrator hooked to my T-suit. Both Jelk-holding cubes were on my belt. The captured Jelk seemed more agitated than ever. I believe they had a good idea what this gun did and how they would each power a shot. Rollo kept scanning one snowflake after... That one, I whispered as a sharp pain spiked in my head. At the same time, I could see in my mind's eye a Baden's head coming up sharply. Let's go, I said. He can sense me. Rollo stared at me hard. Finally, with his voice more hoarse than ever, he gave the command. We will transfer in four, three, two, one, now, N7 said through the comm. He was on the bridge. We are transferring. The transferring sensations cut in. The moment the strange feelings quit, I tapped on my T-suit scanner. Link to me, I whispered. I felt to Baden a second before I saw him on the scanner. He was huge, just like he'd been in his spacesuit. He was dark, like clotted blood, but had classically handsome features. The eyes swirled with power, with extreme menace and evil. I sucked in my breath upon seeing his eyes, working to tear my gaze free. He wore a metallic, iron-colored garment up to his neck. There were computer-like monitors on his chest and several big weapons on his belt. He was like some dark Greek god and seemed intelligent and forceful beyond anything I'd known. His appearance called to mind images of fictional vampire princes or the way humans imagine Satan might look. Ella was chained by the neck and wore little in the way of clothes. The end of the leash was in Abaddon's left hand. She appeared downcast, defeated in spirit. Several cargs stood nearby with big rifles in their tentacles. I saw one other person, a tall woman with dark hair. She had elongated features and a sinister smile. Like a badden, she wore a metallic garment that did nothing to hide her womanly contours. It had to be Jennifer. She had a long knife in her hand, the blade gleaming with electric power. Are you seeing this? Rollo asked over the suit comm. Ready? I whispered. He's expecting us, Rollo told me. Do we have a choice? No, the first admiral said. Right, I said. It's clobbering time. Chapter 37 Pressing the teleport switch was hard. My thumb seemed to travel for an eternity. I wondered if this was how it had felt in World War I. 
There, soldiers had heard a whistle blow. Then they climbed up the trench ladder or scrambled up the trench on their hands and knees and charged the enemy with a rifle and bayonet. They had walked or run across no man's land and crawled through reams of barbed wire. All the while, enemy machine gunners had mowed them down. How had the Tommy boys found the courage to walk forward into the teeth of streams of lead? Maybe a similar numbed courage moved my thumb. Maybe it wasn't courage, but soldierly stupidity. Maybe that's what valor was, part manliness and part craziness. I moved my thumb against the switch and found myself shouting as I appeared in Abaddon's chamber. It was a big room with screens on the walls. I saw Abaddon peering at me on the screens. He'd known we were coming, all right, and he'd known the exact spot. As I materialized, heavy slugs wind off my T-suit armor, staggering me. They knocked the Ultrix disintegrator out of my hands. Surrender, Abaddon said in a dark voice full of authority. Part of me wanted to grovel right there. How did one disobey the voice of a god? I saw Dimitri throw himself onto his face before Abaddon. Put down your weapons, Abaddon ordered. The cargs kept firing, the heavy slugs hammering against me, making it hard to think. I heard Rollo roar a battle cry. He fired back, and a carg exploded into metallic and fleshy parts. That helped me. I used my T-suit's beam and the gun, chugging shots, blowing apart the hated cargs and firing at others. Then I centered on Abaddon. He jerked the leash so Ella cried out, pulled into my line of fire. The beam and slugs tore her into a rag of flesh. Afterward, the beam and slugs almost struck Abaddon. A force field kept them from reaching him, however. No! I howled. You're a murderer, Abaddon said in a voice dripping with judgment. If he thought that would break me, he was wrong. I went berserk instead. I'd killed Ella. I hadn't meant to, but she was dead anyway. Jennifer, for who else could she be, moved like Greece death at that point. She reached Dimitri and yanked a power cord from his pack to the teleportation device. The Cossack tried to rise. Jennifer slapped sticky pods to him. They expanded with startling speed, wrapping him in a vile cocoon. I was beyond speech or I would have warned Rollo to watch out. My best friend seemed to have lost it as well. He was down on one knee, blasting away, hammering cargs into smithereens. Many of their slugs struck him, but it didn't matter. Rollo had braced himself against them, and the Ronin Nine body armor held. I felt like the Angel of Death come to wreak retribution upon Abaddon, the Lord of Evil. I reached the Ultrix disintegrator, picked it up, shoved a jelk-filled cube into the chamber, and targeted Abaddon. You're making a mistake, he said. I felt him reaching out with his mind power. He struck, but I had steeled my will behind a curtain of rage. Despite the wateriness in my eyes, despite the throb of pain, I howled with battle fury. I centered the Ronin Nine weapon and pressed the firing stud. A silent screech cut off Abaddon's mind assault. I realized without knowing how that the jelk in the cube was pleading for mercy. It didn't matter. I kept my finger on the firing switch. In a swift act of justice, the disintegrator devoured the glowing machine ball. The jelk fed the weapon power, and the thing discharged a short but savage beam of ultimate destruction. Like a gush, it swept at Abaddon, striking him on the chest instead of his head as I'd aimed. The mighty Abaddon shouted with pain as he tumbled from his throne onto the floor. Smoke billowed from his form. The metal garment at that spot had curled away to expose the wound. Golden ichor flowed out of the rent, and I almost expected to see bone. I raged joyously at his pain. I think I surprised him. I think Abaddon had forgotten about the Ultrix disintegrator. Maybe he hadn't torn that from Ella's mind yet. Maybe he just thought his armor and force field proof against my weapon. I just taught him otherwise. I clicked the weapon. The spent and darkened cube tumbled onto the floor. I shoved my last captured jelk into the chamber. Cretan, Abaddon roared. Dead man, I said, targeting him. Abaddon squeezed his eyes closed. I supposed he feared death. A halo appeared around him. What did I care about that? I fired the Ronin Nine weapon. It discharged a ferocious gout of energy. Abaddon disappeared. The energy burned through the spot where he'd been, drilling through deck after deck until it must have reached the outer bulkhead. At the same time, Abaddon appeared beside me on his feet. He had teleported. The halo must have had something to do with that. I thought it had been a last-ditch protection against my gun. 
Abaddon snatched the Ultrix disintegrator from my hands. His shoulder muscles bulged and more golden ichor flowed from the chest wound. With a grunt, he broke the ancient weapon. Then he reached for me. The result of my last shot saved me from those deadly hands. The gout of energy had burned through to the outer hull. Air whistled out into the vacuum of space, causing masses of debris to swirl into our chamber. Abaddon swatted at things flying at his face. I took that moment to backpedal, looking around. I'd failed. I'd had two shots and I'd failed to kill Abaddon. I'd wounded him, though. Jennifer raced to the hole, slapping something over it, sealing us from the vacuum. That caused the debris to fall to the deck. Then everything seemed to go crazy. Balls of energy oozed through the walls. Some of the pulsating energy balls halted. Others oozed back the way they had come as if running away. One materialized into a jelk. Right, I thought. The balls of energy had been jelk in their real form. The one that cloaked flesh around it looked familiar. I found myself staring at Shaw Cloth. He looked exactly as I'd remembered him. He wore a blue suit and fancy shoes. He had red skin and satanically intelligent eyes. He was the size of a tall child. I realized he was yelling at me, gesturing wildly. Finally, his words penetrated my sound receptors. It's a trap, you stupid beast, Cloth shouted. Grab me and teleport back to your ship. Do it now before Abaddon regains his senses. Move, you brute. Do something intelligent for once. The conniving creep infuriated me. I had no idea what the Jelk had in mind, but his words made sense after a fashion. Rollo, Dimitri, I said over the suit comm. Retreat to the Santa Maria. We have to regroup. Rollo disappeared. Go, I told Dimitri. Then I grabbed Cloth, hugging his little body to my tea suit You have lost, Abaddon told me. I gave the Dark One the finger. Before Abaddon could respond, I teleported back to the Santa Maria with Cloth as my prisoner. Chapter 38 I shoved the Jelk away from me as I materialized onto the bridge of the Santa Maria. Several officers gasped in surprise. Trask turned to me. He was a small old man in a crisp uniform. Commander, Karg squads have landed en masse on the moon's surface. They have breached bombs and have entered the corridors. I estimate something in the nature of a million soldiers. We cannot possibly fight them off. Once they reach the engine rooms... A T-suit popped onto the bridge. Cloth whirled around. Shoot him, Commander. It's one of Abaddon's creatures. No, Rollo said. It's me, Creed. I reached for the jelk to shake him. Cloth neatly dodged my suited hands and straightened his garment after stepping out of reach. What are your orders, sir? Trask asked. Transfer, I said dully. To what coordinates, sir? The next star system, I said. You'd better go farther than that, Cloth said. Abaddon will reach you otherwise. I stared at the jelk, realizing he'd run to me for help. After all these years, wondering if I could ever hunt down Cloth, the cunning schemer had run to me for sucker. Transfer immediately, Trask. We'll pick different coordinates once there. Yes, sir, Trask said. The old man turned and began issuing orders. In less than a minute, we left the superfleet, with at least one million cargs working their way into the guts of the Santa Maria. Cloth was right about one thing. Abaddon tried another mind assault while we were here. It happened while Rollo and I shoved Cloth ahead of us. We went to the viewing chamber. I grunted and went to one knee. I resisted the mind assault by getting as angry as I could. Abaddon probed. I could almost hear him, but fought against it. Finally, the mind attack ended and I climbed to my feet. You okay, Creed? Rollo asked. No, I whispered. But let's figure out where to transfer next. We have to move farther away from Abaddon. The first one must be hurt, Cloth said. You can thank whatever deity you worship for that. Otherwise, Abaddon would have dominated your beastly mind like that. The Jelk snapped thin red fingers. Rollo raised a gun at Cloth. Do you want me to waste him? What good would that do you? Cloth asked Rollo. You beasts have always baffled me. Why don't you start using your minds for once? I swatted Cloth across the back of the head, making him stagger. We're not beasts, I told him. I thought I taught you that a long time ago. 
You certainly act like beasts, he said, rubbing the back of his head. Standing around and arguing wouldn't help anything, so we continued to the scanning room. In short order, Rollo and I chose another star system. We transferred again, around fifty light years away from the super fleet. I didn't want to take us to the solar system, not with a million cargs on board. I wasn't sure yet what kind of equipment they had brought with them. Could the cargs launch off the moon ship to attack elsewhere? Cloth cocked his head thoughtfully, finally nodding. I think we're far enough from Abaddon. He grinned at me. It was a smile filled with toothy relief. Well done, Commander, Cloth said. That was astonishing. You have my full appreciation, believe me. I couldn't let you know that until out of range of the First One's filthy mind powers. What are you trying to pull, you weasel? Rollo demanded. The Jelk blinked at us in what appeared genuine surprise. Surely you two cannot hold old times against me. Much has changed since then. We are allies of the gun, are we not? What is that supposed to mean? I asked. Cloth made a bland gesture. It seems obvious enough. Abaddon has a larger gun than either of us. He has forced us to recalibrate our attitudes toward each other. Once we considered each other as enemies. Now we have become friends of the gun. Friends of convenience, you might say. We're going to kill you, Rollo said. Cloth arched his eyebrows. Whatever for? I have what you need. You have something I could use. We should work together in order to defeat Abaddon. Hold it. I told Rollo. I want to get out of my suit before we start this. I need a drink and I need to think. Guard him while I get out of this. We traded guard duty as we each climbed out of our T suits and bio suits. Afterward, I wore my 44 and Rollo had a pulse gun. We all went to a cafeteria, getting coffee and sandwiches. I'd like to say I was too sick at heart to eat after losing both Ella and Dimitri, but that would be a lie. I drank several cups of coffee and wolfed down three sandwiches. Rollo did likewise, just more of both, and as he glared at Cloth with murderous intent. Finally, I sat back. I couldn't believe I'd killed Ella. I couldn't believe I'd lost the Ultrix Disintegrator. At least I'd wounded Abaddon. The Lord of Evil had gotten a surprise there. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around what happened, Rollo said in a hoarse voice. I can't believe we lost Dimitri. And Ella, I said. Ella was your assault trooper companion? Cloth asked. I stared at him before nodding. She did not die, Cloth said. Don't lie to me. I saw her die. You saw a robot likeness of her, Cloth said. She's too precious to Abaddon to allow you to simply slay. What? I said as hope raised its head in my heart. Commander, why do you think we Jelk rushed to Abaddon's quarters once we escaped our confinement? What are you talking about? Cloth put his fine-boned hands on the table. Do you even know what happened on the ship? Yes, I saw Jennifer. Who? Surely you remember her, I said. She was one of your nurses when you first came to Earth. Oh, the modified one, Cloth said, nodding. We can't believe anything he says, Rollo said hotly. He's a liar, at best telling half-truths to suit his agenda. Maybe his half-truths are all we have left, I said. I mean, what else is there? We lost the disintegrator, the jelt catcher. The what? Cloth asked. And we have a million cargs on the Santa Maria, I said, ignoring our guest. Maybe we'd better hear what Cloth has to say. I know we both hate him, but maybe he has a point about being allies of the gun. We're losing our friends, and if we don't do something quick, we'll lose our great vessel, our last hope of saving Earth. No, Cloth said. You cannot save Earth. It is doomed. But you are correct about the ship. It is a lovely vessel. We can survive many long years by fleeing. I drew my forty-four, aiming it at Cloth's head. Listen to me carefully. I can still transfer back to Abaddon. I'll pop outside with my tea suit and leave you there. The first one can catch you and do whatever he was going to do to you, Jelk. Cloth appeared thoughtful. Yes, I take your point, Commander. 
I should be the one asking you what happened. This is the ancient survey vessel. You have two Ronin 9 tea suits. The only place to have acquired those. Ah, this has become quite interesting. I had not realized you'd seen the curator. Yes, this silly plan has his ineptness written all over it. I see he hasn't gotten any wiser over time. Who are you talking about? Rollo demanded. Cloth raised an eyebrow and glanced at me. Start talking, I told him. How come all you jelk were prisoners? How come others weren't? Why did you run to me, Cloth? What's going on here? Are you claiming to be Abaddon's enemy? Of course, he said. Don't you remember the portal planet? I asked. You screwed us by helping Abaddon. That was then, Cloth said with a shrug. This is a new day. We are allies of the gun, as I said earlier. Don't worry about the past. Seek to survive the future. What's your story, Jelk? If you don't start talking... Yes, yes, Cloth said, interrupting. Enough of your beastly threats. Here, in a nutshell, is what has been happening with me. Chapter 39 it was strange listening to Cloth after all this time. Long ago, he'd turned us into assault troopers. He'd seemed so much larger than life then. He'd been the master of humanity's fate. Later, he'd become the man who controlled the system. We'd rebelled against Cloth in order to win our freedom. Then he became the renegade Jelk. He helped Abaddon reach our space-time continuum. Cloth was a survivor. That was the essence of his story. He'd learned to roll with the punches millennia ago. Abaddon had reached our space-time continuum with hopes of uniting his cargs with the Jelk Corporation. Cloth had slipped away from the first one, racing in a starship to warn his brethren. Thanks to Cloth's timely advice, the Jelk Corporation had turned their power against this terrible enemy of everyone and everything. Cloth had risen high in the Jelk councils, showing the other Jelk how to defeat Abaddon and trick the raging cargs. But, Cloth said, we had forgotten the cunning of a first one. Among them, Abaddon was known for his cleverness. I think, too, the Dark One knew where ancient devices had been hidden. He couldn't trick the ancient artifacts. They were proof against him. That was critical. If the Forerunner objects had helped Abaddon, we would have had to serve him for eons. As it is... Cloth cocked his head. The ancient survey vessel was his latest find. I'm surprised... Just a minute, I said, interrupting. I've let you talk for a while. Now I have some questions. By all means, Cloth said with his easy smile. I am at your service. I squinted at him. Did Abaddon defeat the Jelk Corporation in the Core Worlds, or did you decide to become allies of the gun? He winced slightly, looking away, and shrugged his narrow shoulders. I would not say we allied with him. So Abaddon defeated you? Cloth glared at me. Certainly not. We are the Jelk Corporation. Nobody defeats us. Sure they do, I said. All those Jelk at the end had just escaped confinement, unless you lied to us about that. I have no reason to lie. I'm glad to hear it. So what happened? How did all you Jelk become prisoners? Cloth pinched his lower lip. We had a parley. What kind of parley? He frowned into the distance, speaking slowly. We agreed to meet with Abaddon in the Onyx system. That's in the heart of the Core Worlds. The first one came with his masses, and we met him in our thousands. I'm referring to battle jumpers. For five weeks he spoke with us, attempting to win us over to his plan. Oh, Abaddon was clever, but even more importantly... None of us recalled sufficiently his powers of mind. As he spoke to us in turn, using his charm, the first one secretly read our thoughts. Even more treacherously, he implanted ideas into our subconsciousness. Slowly, we found ourselves agreeing with his ideas. They were so grand and glorious. After centuries of fruitless war against the religious besotted Jade League, the Corporation would rule the entire Orion Arm. Abaddon promised that us as our fief. He would conquer inward using our mercenary armies. 
Yes, Cloth said. We plan to raise such a host as to startle the curator and the inward races. They would know fear. They would rue the day they had turned on the Jelk, forcing us to flee the savagery of the fringe zones. The corporation has worked tirelessly to raise the standard of culture and technology in the Orion Arm. Have any thanked us for our efforts? No. Always they resist, hating us, unwilling to give the corporation the due our hard work deserves. In other words, I said dryly, the other races failed to treat the Jelk as gods. Yes, Cloth said, slapping the table. Would that be too much to ask? We gave the other races so much. You cannot imagine how they groveled in ignorance before our coming. Creed, Rollo said suddenly. How does this kind of talk rid the Santa Maria of the Cargs? Maybe he's lulling us to buy them time. By no means, Cloth said. My intentions are honorable. What about the Jelk in Creed's disintegrator? Rollo demanded. Don't you care they died? Ha, huh, Cloth said. Oxrax and Simibaoji deserved annihilation, the traitors. They groveled to Abaddon, allowing the Dark One to place inhibitors in their being. They were no longer free agents, but slaves in the worst sense of the word. The rest of us went into confinement rather than to allow an inhibitor put into our essence. Yes, I am aware that they retained their jeltness. Possibly they could have multiplied later, thus eventually freeing themselves from Abaddon's control. I suspect that was their reasoning. Cloth shook his head at such stupidity. The margin for error was too high. It was folly. What are you talking about? Rollo shouted. Cloth closed his mouth, sitting straighter. He glanced at me and his smile returned. What? Rollo asked, looking from me to Cloth. The commander understands me, Cloth said, indicating me. Rollo rose like a grizzly bear. I had the feeling he would attempt to rip Cloth's arms from his torso. Instead, the big man turned, stomping out of the cafeteria. You do understand me, don't you? Cloth asked. I figured I did. Abaddon had tricked the Jelk. They had agreed to become his allies. In doing so, they fell under his power. Eventually, the Jelk realized their error. At that point, Abaddon gave them a choice. Take the inhibitor in their essence, becoming his slave until such time as they divide it into renewed halves, or go into confinement. How did Abaddon confine you? I asked. Partly through his amazing mind powers and partly through ancient First One hardware, Cloth said. It is like a forerunner object and like... The little jelk frowned. Like the original AI you escaped? I asked. Cloth's head jerked as he stared at me. His eyes burned for an instant. His old villainy shone through, and he hunched his shoulders, hissing like a snake. Abruptly, he looked away, stood, shivered several seconds, and slowly brought himself under control. He sat back down, facing me with a seemingly placid smile. His eyes were hooded now. That, he said, was long, long ago. I... Do not like to remember that time. Okay, I said. His eyebrows rose. Okay, he asked. You were slaves in the beginning, right? No, but you didn't like it in the original AI. He seemed to freeze, probably in an attempt to control his emotions. I did not like it there, Cloth said softly. Why did the Jelk become the ultimate capitalists? Why do you seek riches and luxury? He blinked at me as if I were a cretin. What else is there? he asked. I studied him. There is no such thing as a soul, Cloth said. That is an invention of you flesh creatures. It is a mind disease, in fact. The Jade League seethes with it. The other races are insane? Yes, that is a good way to put it. They do not see reality as it is, as we do. Perhaps that comes from our original confinement. We see deeper than others. Or maybe you don't see as deeply, I said. That is preposterous, he said. We are the Jelk, the ultimate realists. There is nothing but the here and now. The accumulation of capital, of things, is everything. There is nothing else but this delusion of souls. 
That is a false path for the weak-minded. Does Abaddon share your beliefs? Cloth cocked his head. That is a shrewd question, he said with something like surprise. I am unsure. He seeks power instead of riches. In the end, the two are different paths to the same end. Comfort and enjoyment. Abaddon doesn't strike me as someone out to enjoy himself, I said. Perhaps you're right. I raised my cup and found that my remaining coffee had gotten cold. I got up, tossed the coffee into the sink, and brewed more. I returned to the table with the fresh cup, sipping the steaming liquid. So, I said, when I wounded Abaddon, the locks on our cages came loose. We had been hoping for something like that. I suppose Abaddon is recapturing the others. I, with my greater knowledge and quicker ability to decide, realized I had to get far away from him. That left you as the only avenue for escape. You didn't fear my wrath? I asked. To date, you haven't been able to kill a Jelk. Yes, with the Roni 9 weapon you did, but Abaddon destroyed the gun. Thus, it seemed that the most logical choice was to go with you and convince you to do the right thing. What would that be? I asked. As Cloth started to answer, Rollo appeared in a tea suit. He aimed his beam at Cloth. What are you doing? The Jelk asked. The beam poured from the orifice, striking Cloth, burning into his flesh. Abaddon is controlling him! The Jelk shouted. Stop him before it's too late! Rollo kept beaming, and in a moment, Cloth exploded into a ball of bright energy. Chapter 40 In my haste to get out of the way, I spilled coffee on my shirt. At the same time, the ball of energy floated upward. Rollo! I shouted. Was he under Abaddon's control? Had the Dark One planted a post-hypnotic command deep in Rollo's subconscious? The beam stopped and Rollo lowered his suited arm. He used a suit speaker to talk to me. I'm sick of him, Creed. I'm sick of his haughty ways. I wanted to watch him die in the disintegrator's power chamber. That's all I could think about these past minutes. That we were cheated of our reward. Are you feeling like yourself? I asked. What's that supposed to mean? Cloth suggested that you're under Abaddon's control, I said. The beam weapon arm lifted as Rollo re-aimed at the ball of energy. Don't do it, I said. Cloth is slime, Rollo said in a tight voice. He's trying to use us. I know that. Rollo's silvered visor turned to me as if in surprise. Why are you letting him then? I'm not. I just understand that that's his goal. I have a different goal, though. I made a soft gesture. Do you plan to keep on shooting him? I've thought it over, Creed. It has to take energy to form flesh, to go from one state to another. If one made cloth change states over and over again, maybe that would eat up his energy reserves. Maybe that would be like starving cloth to death. I tapped my chin, considering that. It was a novel idea, certainly. I hate him, Rollo said flatly as he turned to watch the floating energy ball. The energy changed color, becoming a deep red. Slowly, it took on a humanoid shape. I share your feelings, I quietly told Rollo. But we need him, as I'm out of ideas. We have a million cargs working down to us. Abaddon has Dimitri, Ella, and Jennifer. Maybe the little creep can come up with an idea. But he won't be able to tell us if you keep forcing him into his energy state. Yeah, Rollo said. He finally nodded. I'm done for now. You do what you gotta. Count me in for whatever it is. With that, the tea suit vanished. I touched the wet stain on my shirt. With a shrug, I returned to the pot, pouring myself another cup. I sipped and silently debated strategies as Cloth pulled himself together. After a time, I heard a chair leg scrape against the floor as Cloth sat down. I peered at him sideways. He looked different, but it was barely noticeable. There was a slight discoloration on his right cheek and his nose seemed sharper than last time. Did Rollo have the right idea about starving Jelk to death by forcing them through repeated flesh-to-energy transformations? It seemed doubtful, but it was an interesting idea to have come from my meat house friend. Was that a planned event? Cloth asked coldly. Ah, you're back, I said, facing him. I hope that wasn't too painful. It was quite painful, and I resent it. Oh. Don't try to pretend. You already knew it hurt. 
Why else would any jelk exhibit pain symptoms at his bodily demise? That's a good point, I said, taking another sip of coffee. I was starting to feel shaky from the caffeine. Maybe I should stop for today. Worry crossed his reshaped features. Are we allies of the gun or not? he asked. I took my time answering. That depends, I said. On? On whether you can help me or not, I said. I assure you I can. I'm not interested in assurances. I want proof. What should we do now? What is the precise objective? he asked. Freeing my friends and killing Abaddon. Cloth moved a saucer with his fingers as his features pinched up in thought. Looking up at me, he said, We may not be able to free your friends. Why? Because all this, he said with a wave of his hand, is taking too long. I raised my cup, made to sip, and then hurled the cup and remaining coffee from me. The cup shattered against a far wall. Cloth jerked in surprise, staring at me. Then he glanced about as if searching for Rollo. Listen, I said, putting my hands on the edge of the table, leaning toward him. How do we kill Abaddon without a disintegrator? I have no idea. You didn't have a plan for killing him? We, meaning the Jelk Corporation, have had several plans. They all failed. If you don't know how to kill him, what good are you to me? I asked. You don't understand. Killing a first one was always hard. They had powers no other race ever exhibited. But I think Abaddon has become greater than any other first one. He developed in the other space-time continuum. He has become the greatest being alive. He's a danger to everyone. We thought. Yes, I said. You thought what? Cloth shook his head. It doesn't matter. You had the greatest weapon ever made by another race, the Ultrix Disintegrator. It hurt Abaddon, which proves the curator was right in giving it to you. Now it's gone. Now the Kargs are charging down here. Do you want my suggestion? Let's hear it. We must rid the craft of Kargs and go to another galaxy. We can start over. Maybe in time Abaddon will come after us. Maybe ruling an entire galaxy will be enough for his vaulting ambition. In truth, though, I believe he is afflicted with the worst of the flesh diseases. What's that? Abaddon seeks to kill the Creator. I stared at Cloth. Yet, the Jelk said, how does one go about killing an imaginary being? That seemed to come out of left field. It surprised me. How do you know the Creator is imaginary? I asked. Commander, please, Cloth said. It is a vain and foolish concept. The Creator, as conceived, does not exist. How do you know that? I asked. Have you been to every point in the universe to check? Clearly I have not. Then how do you know he doesn't exist? Bah, Cloth said. I reject your argument. Here, I'll show you why it's futile. I believe there is a cosmic joker who causes each of us to trip and fall for his sick amusement. But you'll tell me that is a phantasm of my imagination. People trip and fall because they are clumsy. At that point, my eyes will gleam with righteous indignation. I will say, it is self-evident the cosmic joker exists. If you say he doesn't, I'll simply ask you if you've been to every point in the universe to check. Obviously, none of us has been to every place in the universe. Does that mean whatever creature we concoct in our fantasies is true? All right, I said. You don't believe in the Creator. Frankly, I don't care if you do or not. I want to know how to kill Abaddon. I have already told you I don't know. Repeating the question won't magically force me to give you an answer I don't have. I turned away. Was Abaddon unbeatable then? The curator had given me the Ultrix Disintegrator. I stood. I had my answer. If I didn't know, if Cloth didn't know, there was still one person who might. I had to get back to that person and ask. I headed for the exit. Where are you going? Cloth asked. To the bridge, I said. Aha, he said, jumping up. You have renewed your hope. I see it in your bearing. I am interested in this. I will join you. I studied Cloth. 
He seemed at ease. What just happened? I asked. Why are you so boisterous all of a sudden? It's not me. It's you. You've thought of something. I wish to observe how you operate. Time and again you have done what I considered impossible. I would like to know your secrets in order to employ them myself some day. As I listened to him, I realized something. It made me smile inwardly. I had an idea, but Cloth wasn't going to like it. Neither was the other guy I planned to see. Everyone was going to be angry with me, but that was okay. I was pretty pissed off right now myself. When I got like this, I liked pissing off others. Cloth trailed me to the bridge. The crew stared at him for a time. Maybe they wondered why I was giving the Jelk so much freedom. Finally, the crew went back to work, plotting the coordinates to our next destination. I'd spoken quietly to Captain Trask, so Cloth didn't know where we were headed. I finally started for a chair. What is our destination? Cloth asked, following me. I turned and told him. It left Cloth stunned and then frightened looking. Chapter 41 The Santa Maria appeared at Sagittarius A-Star. I came here feeling like we were a plague ship, as I carried a million cargs. The last time we'd shown up, the curator had threatened to use Antiforce to rid the vessel of a few skinnies in their electrical suits. I had a feeling Antiforce wouldn't work against anti-life cargs. The problem was that it looked as if we'd transferred into the middle of a battle. We have to get out of here, Commander, Cloth shouted. The V-Kai are finally making good on their boast. They're storming the museum. From all around the accretion disk circling the supermassive black hole poured VIP-92 attack vessels. The lead energy ships already hammered the ancient structure with their energy blob missiles. I did notice that none of those missiles teleported. They traveled the old-fashioned way, dissipating energy as they zipped toward the Fortress of Light. So far, a force field kept most of those missiles from the structure. In a small area, however, a few missiles flew through a visible force field hole, slamming against the fortress directly. The armored spot had become red-hot and pulsated darker every time another missile struck. Commander, Captain Trask said, giving me a nervous glance. The readings from those energy missiles are off the charts. If the V-Kai direct them at us, our vessel will explode in short order. Cloth shook his head. It is a terrible pity, but I'm afraid the curator is doomed. The Jelk made tisking sounds. The curator toyed with the V-Kai too long, it appears. He should have made peace with them or transferred his abode elsewhere when he had the chance. I deem it likely that he was too arrogant to contemplate such a rational course. I felt like I had a crocodile beside me shedding false tears. Have you seen enough? Cloth asked me. I ignored him, telling Trask, We're going in. But sir, Trask said. You spout madness, Cloth told me. The curator is doomed. We cannot help him. We must save ourselves before the V-Kai turn on us. They might conclude you're considering helping the senile old fool. Shut up, I told Cloth. We don't have any choice in the matter, I said to Trask. Yes, sir, our acting captain said. You are a vain and foolish. Don't say it, I warned Cloth. Certain he was about to call me a beast. You are a vain starship, Captain. The Jelk finished lamely. He seemed to reconsider his line of reasoning, nodding. There are moments for brash actions. I concede the point. You have proven it on more than one occasion. This, however, is certainly not one of those times. Retreat certainly seems to be in order, don't you agree? I eyed Cloth. He looked green around the gills, figuratively speaking, as he studied the vast fleet of VIP-92s. I wondered about that. How do you know about the V-Kai? I asked. Cloth shrugged as if the matter was of no importance. An itch in my brain blossomed into an insight. The V-Kai were material beings with energy ships and electrical combat suits. Jelk were energy beings who wore flesh and blood disguises. The V-Kai didn't have anything to do with your original escape, did they? Cloth laughed nervously. What a preposterous notion, Commander. This is the center of the galaxy. The law's here. Tell me later, I said. Captain, why haven't we transferred yet? I'd seen two men yank the main levers to initiate the process. 
We should have, Trask said, frowning severely. But something... The transfer took place then. It had been delayed for some reason, which seemed ominous. With a clang and a hard shake, the Santa Maria docked onto the Fortress of Light. Commander, Cloth said in a rush, this is a terrible, a grave and odious mistake. I realize now what you must have been thinking. The curator seems like a kindly human, but I must warn you that he is a vicious meddler, a master deceiver, and filled with the wickedest guile imaginable. We must run before he appears. As if on cue, the main bridge doors swished open. Everyone looked up to see who was coming. The big old man with the white beard and blue robe hurried onto the bridge. The curator looked worried and angry, and he gripped a long metal staff in a gnarled old hand. Don't believe a word he says, Cloth whispered to me. He will try to dupe you, have no doubt about that. The vicious entity never should have interfered in matters that didn't concern him. He has a long and bitter memory. I suspect he has already threatened more than once to slay every one of you if you step out of line. That is his way, his evil, foul, and despicable way. Commander Creed, the curator said loudly. What is the meaning of... The big old man stopped short, his blue eyes widening in surprise. Cloth slid behind me as if I could shield him. Commander, the old man said. Is that a jelk in your company? I grabbed Cloth by the scruff of the neck, dragging him in front of me. It is a jelk, the curator said. This is astonishing. He banged the end of the metal staff on the deck. It made a much louder boom than it should have. Shah Cloth, step forward. To my surprise, Cloth tore himself free of my grip as he woodenly began to walk toward the curator. As he did, Cloth turned his head as if his neck was rusted iron. He gave me an imploring look. Cloth's lips seemed sealed shut, but he struggled. Finally, he tore them open, shouting, Please, Commander, help me. Don't let him take me. This is wrong and vile. I watched, spellbound. What exactly was happening here? I'm sorry for everything I ever did wrong to you, Cloth shouted. I didn't mean any of it. Please, Commander. I once saved what was left of the human race. You owe me for that. As much as I hated to admit it, he had a point. Certainly, Cloth had never done anything that wasn't for his own good first, but he had chased off the Lohar dreadnought that would have finished off the last one percenters. Curator, I said. This doesn't concern you, the old man said curtly. I didn't like his prompt dismissal of me, but maybe the curator had a point, too. Creed, the jelk wailed. I don't want to go back. Please help me. I'll give you anything you want. I'll help you free Jennifer. I know Abaddon's secrets. I can help you destroy him. Then you should have spoken up sooner, I said. I think it's too late for you now. No, he wailed. Now Cloth tried to resist. His feet continued to move woodenly, though, as he twisted like a wet cat. Finally, almost against his will, the jelk regarded the waiting curator. I curse you, Cloth screeched. Don't you think I've felt your curses all around me for millennia? The old man asked. You helped us once, Cloth said. That was then. No, Cloth wailed. He threw his arms into the air. In a flash, his flesh and blood disguise vaporized and he became his true self. It's about time, the curator said. He aimed the top of the staff at the ball of energy. Cloth and his original machine self remorselessly floated toward the staff. The energy ball wriggled. It tossed. And then it zipped into the staff. For a moment, the staff quivered, turning red at the tip. The redness moved up the staff like a meal moving up a snake's belly. Finally, the redness faded until the staff was like before, a metal rod in the old man's left hand. Well, 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 the curator said. That was unexpected. Shah Cloth has come home. You must have surprised him by coming here. I nodded. The curator smiled and then frowned, seeming to suddenly remember why he'd come down to us. What happened, Commander? Sir, I said. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but haven't you been watching what happened with Abaddon and me? The curator eyed my crew. He eyed me and then studied his staff before regarding me again. Walk with me, Commander. 
You and I have a few serious matters to discuss. Chapter 42 The door swished shut behind us, leaving the curator and me alone in the corridor. Sir, I said, the V-Kai are attacking your fortress en masse. How many times must I tell you? This is not my place. It is the creator's fortress. I am simply the caretaker. Yes, I said. That's what I meant. Then please say what you mean. It will make things much easier between us. As you wish, I said. He looked down at me, then he looked up at the ceiling. Perhaps I can use your appearance to my benefit. You have cogs in the upper decks. That is disgusting, to say the least. They are vile creatures with a killing lust you cannot conceive of. Oh, no. You can conceive of their lust to kill. It possesses you from time to time, along with that apishly huge First Admiral of yours. In any regard, the V-Kai will soon breach my upper levels, as this is an unprecedented assault. Perhaps I can employ the cogs for a time. Fight fire with fire? I asked. That is an apt saying. Perfectly apt, he said. Now wait a moment. I have to do this right. He swept his arms wide and stared at the staff in his grip as if it was a problem, then shoved the staff at me. Hold this a moment, would you? I accepted the staff and almost dropped it on the floor. It was incredibly heavy. I had to use both arms and still found it pressing down like the mythical hammer of Thor. What made this thing so heavy? Freed of the staff, the curator spread his arms and wriggled his fingers. As he'd done once before, he produced a ghostly control panel before himself. He began to sweep and tap gracefully. Images passed on ghostly screens. Flashes of light appeared and disappeared. I had no idea what was going on. He began to move his arms and fingers faster and faster. Finally, the process started freaking me out. I wanted to go home. I wanted regular assault trooper work. This stuff was too different. There, the curator said, clapping his hands. As he did that, the ghostly panel disappeared as if it had never existed. He plucked the staff from me, tapping it on the deck several times. Thank you, my boy, he said. Let us continue. Sir, I said, walking in step beside him, feeling absurdly like a boy walking beside his grandfather. Hmm, he said. If you don't mind me asking, what did you just do? I don't mind. I don't mind at all. I had to reroute the cog reality. It was much harder than you would expect. They are stubborn things, half alive and half machine. They're not cyborgs, as you conceive of them, but a blasphemous mixture. It is quite revolting. In any case, the cogs are no longer charging down here, but flowing back up. They are seeing reality a bit differently from what it is. Soon they will flow against the invading V-Kai troopers. It will be a Karg bloodbath. Not that that will stop the Kargs from attacking. In that matter, they are well suited for the present task. Their seemingly endless assault will give me time. I am sorely pressed, my boy. Sorely pressed indeed. It was most fortuitous that you arrived when you did... The curator stopped walking and talking to stare at me. He seemed a shade paler than before, and there was a hint of perspiration on his brow, which I found extremely odd. He used a sleeve to blot his forehead. What's wrong? I asked. If you can't see it, I won't explain it. I had a feeling I did see. Are you saying my showing up when I did wasn't just by chance, but by design? That isn't important to you, he said. Maybe it is. He nodded a moment later. Yes, maybe it is at that. I have underestimated you, Commander. Maybe it's time for me to stop doing that. How can I be of service? Surely you witnessed everything, I said. Yes, you wounded the egotist. I find it very interesting that Abaddon turned on his Jelk allies. Ah, arrogance brings its own defeat, does it not? I don't mind telling you that that was our hope all along. The first one is the greatest of his kind. Now he has more of your friends. And he destroyed the disintegrator. The curator tightened his grip on the staff. Finally, he lowered the metal rod, extending it to me once more. Grab hold, my boy. 
We're losing time standing here jabbering like monkeys. I'm beginning to understand the situation. The V-Kai are attacking in concert with Abaddon's assault on Earth. That's for a purpose. Likely the Dark One wishes to keep me occupied just a little too long. Are you holding on to the staff? I held on to it with both hands. Don't let go, he warned. I nodded. The staff grew hot. We vanished, reappearing in the same wall-viewing chamber I'd been in before. The curator set the staff against a wall. He made several manipulations in the air. The wall screen shimmered for a time. This is bad, the curator muttered. He stepped away from the giant screen and plucked at his beard. Scowl lines appeared across his forehead. What's going on? I asked. Shh, he said. Let me think. He plucked at his beard more. His staff vibrated. He glanced at it. Then he studied me out of the corner of his eye. He pursed his lips as if considering an idea. Finally, he strode to the staff, grasping it. Wait here, he said. A second later, he was gone. What had that been about? I shrugged. It must have been a warning about the V-Kai that he'd gone to investigate personally. I walked to the great wall screen. It still shimmered. Suddenly, the shimmering lessened. Then the shimmering lines faded away altogether. I found myself staring at the superfleet. It had regrouped, moving as one toward the next jump gate. It would appear Abaddon was still headed for Earth. As I watched, my attention kept going to a particular snowflake vessel, to one moth ship on it. I stared at that ship and faintly fell to Abaddon. The screen shimmered once more and I saw into a vast room. Abaddon sat on a throne addressing several larger-than-normal cargs. The first one grew still until he raised a hand. He looked up, gazing at me. Commander Creed, he said. I noticed that Abaddon's lips moved. That was good to know, as I realized it wasn't mind-to-mind -mind talking, which I would have avoided with extreme prejudice. We spoke person-to-person -person this time. The first one had a rich, strong voice. The intelligence of his features added to the nobility of his appearance. He smiled sardonically at me, and his eyes shone. You took something of mine, he said. I found it difficult to speak, impossible to tear my gaze from his. Ah, he said, you're in the museum. Have you gone groveling to the old fool there, asking for a new weapon? Finally, I forced my lips apart. What are you? I said in a rusty voice. Your only hope, he said. I almost killed you. He peered at me before spreading his arms and slapping his massive chest. Do I look hurt to you? No. No, he said. I am a badden. I am the rightful ruler of this galaxy. Long ago, the others grew afraid of me. Surely you realize that by now. Afraid? I asked. I was too bold. Too strong and willful. I dared to go where others feared. I learned more and grew stronger than they did. That is as it should be, as he who dares wins. I dared more than any other. Finally, I went to investigate the Karg universe. The others were my anchor stone. Foolishly, I still trusted them. Do you know what happened, Commander? The old fool you call the curator backstabbed me. He cut the connection between my anchor and me. He stranded me in the Karg universe, hoping to be rid of his chief competitor. But I am Abaddon. I am the last of the true first ones. I learned lessons that no creature should have to learn. The Kargs thought to tame me. The more fools them. I tamed them. First, I had to learn the hard lessons, become greater than I had ever believed possible. Oh, how I planned, Commander. How I readied the Kargs for the great and glorious conquest. I knew my day would come. I had merely to survive the eons. While doing so, I had to keep my fierce will alive. This I have done. That old fool trying to use you has a reason to fear me. I will find him, and I will teach him lessons. Abaddon stopped in mid-speech. He stared at me as the hatred seemed to drain out of his eyes. 
You understand revenge, do you not? Abaddon asked. I nodded. Yes, he said. You have thwarted some of my ambitions, Commander. Very few in this life have done so. I suppose you believe that you are safe with that old schemer. I didn't know what to say. Abaddon stroked his right cheek. He smiled, nodding as if with understanding benevolence. Commander, he said in a smooth voice, what is it you seek? The survival of my race, I said. I can give that to you. I want my people, too. Dimitri, Ella, and Jennifer, I added. I noticed movement to his left. A tall woman with dark hair raised her head. Her eyes burned with wrath. Jennifer, Abaddon asked. You want Jennifer even after she has been my prize for so many years? Yes, I said. She hates you. I don't blame her for that, I said. She trusted me and I failed her. You failed her miserably, he said. You left her behind. You said you loved her, yet you fled in safety without trying to rescue her. You know I couldn't. I was trying to save a galaxy from you. And look what happened, he said. Here I am. Yes, I said. You're here much weaker than otherwise. If it wasn't for me, you'd have trillions of cargs and billions of starships. You returned with barely enough to hold off the jelk until you tricked them. His features became perfectly still. That was then, he said. The past is the past, I asked sarcastically. It took him time, but he nodded. How come I don't believe you, I asked. He stared at me. Finally, he smiled. It was full of malice, full of hatred. You don't believe me because you know that for you there is no forgiveness. Jennifer loathes you with a bitterness you cannot understand. She will cut open your belly and pull out your guts, laughing the entire time. That's nice, I said, feeling myself beginning to get angry. I have taught her things, Commander. Wicked and evil things that have seared her innocent nature. She knows what it is to hate. You humans. You think you know how to hate, but you have little idea. It takes someone like me, a powerful, long-lived entity, to truly grasp the concept. Too often hate weakens a human. I have taught Jennifer the hatred that gives strength. It is like unto my strength. You hate me? I asked. Yes, Abaddon hissed. I hate you, Commander. I will wreak a fearsome vengeance upon you. You are already starting to realize this. I have taken your friends one by one. I will take more. They will all spit on your groveling form in time. Do you know, Commander Creed, that I shall kick your mewling form from one of my ships to another? There is nothing you can do to change this fate. I don't want to change it, I said. I want you to hate me with everything you have. I thwarted you, Abaddon. I stopped your great plan of vengeance. I made sure you entered this space-time continuum as a weakling compared to how you could have entered as a conquering god. I did that to you. Me. Commander Creed. His eyes began to swirl with power. I forced myself to laugh. That's right, big shot. A mere human thwarted your will. You call yourself a first one. You're a fool. You're a dull-witted strategist. I didn't even do any deep thinking. I just showed up and boom, everything you planned to do for countless centuries vanished. Bring them, he shouted to his minions. You, he said, pointing at me. I slapped my chest. That's right, me, Commander Creed. I'm the guy who did you in, Abaddon. I'm the guy who shot you with a disintegrator, made you feel pain. And you know what? I'm gonna make you feel pain again and again. I don't think so, mortal. I bet that's what you thought heading for the portal planet the first time. You told yourself how you could hardly wait to get back to my space-time continuum and kick some serious butt. How did it feel knowing the portal had closed on all your vast ambitions? Do you remember how you raged at me for that? Do you recall the sinking feeling in the pit of your pathetic gut? Bring me his people! Abaddon roared. 
Abaddon had a volcanic temper. At this point, I didn't care. I hated him. I realized my helplessness to save my friends. I thought, I suppose, deep in my heart, that if I goaded him enough, he would kill them cleanly before they had to suffer a lifetime of torturous agony. Chapter 43 Suddenly the wall screen shimmered again. It felt as if Abaddon's rage had grown so hot that he'd lost some of his mental control over the process. The curator instantly reappeared, almost as if he'd been waiting for this to happen. He dropped a bundle onto the floor, and he gave me such a look that I knew fear and trepidation. I noticed something odd, too. He had a long handle stuck in his belt. "'We have little time,' the curator said. "'I guessed right concerning you and him. Abaddon wants to torture you, Commander, almost as badly as he would like to do so to me. I am the one who cut his anchor, of course. I'm sure you've divined that by now.' I nodded. Do you willingly agree to become my effectuator? he asked. I don't know what that means. Yes, you do. Decide this instant, or it will be too late. Strangely, I had a feeling I did know what he meant. He wanted me to become his errand boy, his troubleshooter. I'm not sure how long I was supposed to do that or in what capacity. I had a feeling it was going to take me away from the assault troopers and from Earth, possibly for the rest of my life. By agreeing, I would buy an opportunity to kill Abaddon and free humanity from extinction. How could I say no? And yet this would be a grave responsibility. I didn't seem like the right person for the job, not even the right kind of person. Yeah, I'm in, I said. You swear this? I swear it. We must hurry, as we have seconds to do this. Put that on, he said, indicating the bundle on the floor. I dashed to it, finding a jangling garment with metallic bands on the sleeves. I put it on, sealing the front against me, finding it much too big. Then the suit molded itself to my form, almost like bioskin, until it fit from neck to toe like a leotard. What is this? I asked. It is like your bioskin in many ways, but it is more advanced and many times more powerful. You're going to need it in a moment. Before I could ask more, the curator took the handle out of his belt, handing it to me. I accepted it. The handle had several buttons on it. That is possibly the last weapon I possess that might be able to slay a badden, he said. Nothing else I have is as powerful. It is a forerunner artifact, possibly more deadly than Holgatha. You depress the buttons in a selected sequence. A force blade of unbelievable magnitude will flow outward. This is a sword? It is more than any sword, I assure you. I stared at it as a feeling of awe made me shiver. Is this like the flaming sword the angel waved while guarding Eden from Adam and Eve? Your weapon has mythic properties, the curator said, which is as it should be, as you will face a mythic foe. Do the two not suit each other? I guess so. The curator breathed deeply. Listen to me, my boy. The way is going to open soon. The wall screen is more than just a screen? I asked. Yes. You're going to teleport me through to kill Abaddon? Are you willing to do this? Can I actually slay him? You have the tools, the curator said. Whether or not you have the ability, even I do not know. Can you pull me back if I start to lose? Not through the one-way teleporter, he said. If I had more time, I am beset by the V-Kai. The cogs haven't exited the survey vessel yet. He stopped talking as the shimmering on the screen lessened. Good luck, Commander Creed. I bid you go in the Creator's name. Kill this upstart first one and I can begin to repair the damage he wrought millennia ago. What if Abaddon kills me and grabs these Forerunner items? The Curator frowned as his shoulders slumped. Then I'm afraid that I will never defeat him. In time, he will reach and kill me. This is it, Commander. This is the moment of decision. If you win, it is likely you can save your friends. Lose, and I'm afraid that Abaddon will take humanity and turn them into his chief servants. Do you have any last words of advice? I asked. The combination to the Force Blade is 2-2-3-1, he said. Got it. I said. 
Do not let him into your mind. How do I stop that? I asked. By becoming so angry that your rage acts as a shield against his thoughts, he said. Something must have caught his attention. The curator glanced sharply at the wall screen. No, the way is clearing too soon. I had hoped to surprise him. You have goaded him as only you can do, Commander. Ready yourself. Don't unleash the force blade until you're on his ship. The curator waved his arms, bringing a ghostly control before him. He tapped wildly as the wall screen became clear. Abaddon was standing. Dimitri and Ella stood before him. Jennifer was to the side. Thirty big cargs were in the chamber with them. Abaddon peered at me, and shock filled him as he glanced at the curator. You! he cried. The curator kept manipulating his ghostly screen. What are you doing, brother? Abaddon shouted. Brother? Were Abaddon and the curator brothers? What was going on here? Go! the curator shouted at me. It is time, and I can't keep the way open long. Open? Abaddon asked. I gripped the handle, gathered my resolve, and shouted at the top of my lungs. Then I raced toward my probable doom. This seemed like insanity. I dashed at the wall, jumping, and I felt myself flowing through. It felt as if I stretched longer and longer. I... Stumbling into the great chamber on the moth ship, I faced Abaddon. I could smell the cargs as I began to press the buttons on my Forerunner artifact handle. Two, two, three, one. Chapter 44 A pure force of energy grew from the Forerunner artifact handle. It radiated an intense bar of light about a meter in length while making a faint humming sound. At the same time, my suit vibrated, filling me with strength and vitality. I felt light, as if I floated on the deck. I glanced down to see if that was the case. No, I stood just as I had been, yet my feet had a halo glowing around them. That must have been from the suit, and obviously indicated something. Kill him, Abaddon said slowly, as if he had trouble mouthing the words. I looked up as the big karg leaders with their metallic tentacles leveled heavy slug throwers at me. One after another they fired, making garbled sounds. To my amazement I could almost see the slugs flying through the air. They were streaks of motion. The astonishment almost froze me. I barely shook off the reverie in time, sidestepping the first bullet. Was that right? Was that what I was doing? Everything seemed to slow down for me the longer I looked. Maybe it took a few seconds for the suit to fully power up. The cargs moved sluggishly. Abaddon spoke in a garbled manner and my friends stood frozen in shock. I sidestepped more slugs. It was becoming easier as they were no longer blurs in the air but actual moving bullets I could see. I considered that as I slid to the left and right again and again. I didn't glance back to see where the bullets went. I was too focused on moving forward. I'd speed it up. That was the only explanation that made sense. As I realized that, I wondered how long I could do something like this. I suspected this would tax my muscles and maybe my bodily systems. Once I took off the suit, would I ache for weeks, for months? Maybe I'd have a heart attack due to overstraining myself. I gave a short bark of laughter. If this was it, a trade, my life for Abaddon's death and the life of my friends, I had no problem with that. Let's get it straight. I didn't want to die. I yearned to live in those moments more than I ever had. I wanted to walk the earth again. I wanted to free Jennifer from the horrors Abaddon had twisted in her mind. I wanted her to forgive me for leaving her behind those many years ago. At the very least, I wanted to tell her I was sorry for doing that. I'm sure that might be hard for some of you to believe. I imagine that by the way I've told my life story, more than a few of you think I was a self-indulgent jerk. Maybe that was true. Maybe I'd acted too harshly along the way, but that's what the situations had called for. Saving mankind hadn't been a task for a nice guy with nice manners. My hand tightened around the forerunner handle. I wanted to live. That's what you have to believe. But the old rage had ignited on the Fortress of Light. I burned with a desire to kill Abaddon. I'd goaded the big bastard. I wanted him to seethe with a desire to defeat me. That way, if I won, I could laugh in his face and it would torment him immensely. I was going to chop off his head if I could. I'd read the story of David and Goliath before. The shepherd boy David had used his sling to conk Goliath on the forehead. The big bad Philistine had crashed to the earth. 
That's when the shepherd boy scampered to the mighty champion and drew the giant's massive sword. With it, David had hacked off the head. According to the story in the good book, David had held Goliath's bloody head by the hair while he'd spoken to the Israelite King Saul. That's what I wanted to do to Abaddon. I wanted to go back to the Fortress of Light and show the curator. A different thought struck. Abaddon was the curator's brother. Maybe the old man in the center of the galaxy would take it ill if I showed him his brother's severed head. I kept slip-sliding closer to the throne, closer to the cargs, who ever so slowly shoved new magazines into their slug throwers. Dimitri had begun shouting my name. Ella's eyes were still wide at the sight of me. I had become the Avenger. I bore weapons of light against the monster of darkness. Abaddon stood. He did it quicker than anyone else had moved in the chamber. The meaning of that hadn't dawned on me yet. I was too focused on my thoughts of holding his severed head. The first faint flickering of his mind power touched my thoughts. It was an intrusion, like that noise in the night that made you wonder, made you frown and think about whipping off the cover so you could go check it out. The floorboard creak became like footsteps. Then it turned into a shout and an outline of a stalker in your bedroom, cradling a shotgun as he threatened to tie you up and rape your wife in front of your eyes. I suppose any of a number of things could have happened at that moment. The suddenness of Abaddon's mind assault might have frozen me. That would allow the cargs to riddle my body with slugs. When I'd been in high school, I'd had a bad dream. I'd felt as if I'd woken up and felt a grim presence of evil standing by the foot of my bed. It had watched me. I'd been frozen in fear at that, unable to move or speak. Then the curtains beside my bed fluttered. I'd known that someone was sneaking in through the window. With great terror, I'd shouted, lunging upward from my bed, trying to grab the intruder before he shot me. Back then, I'd woken myself up from the nightmare. The curtains had been fluttering because I'd forgotten to shut my window. The presence of evil had also departed. That same kind of evil feeling slammed against my mind now. Creed. Abaddon spoke in my mind. I stared at the creature who was five times my size. His eyes burned with authority with evil that threatened to steal my courage. I knew, though, that if I faltered, he would tie me up. He would do worse than rape my wife before my eyes. Rage swept through my being. It was a righteous force that pulsated with desire. The demon from another space-time continuum had toyed with me for the last time. He had screwed with my friends for the last time. My hatred blocked his mind talk. It sealed me in my own universe. I did not go berserk. Instead, a cold and ruthless fury motivated my actions. Abaddon concentrated on me as two left-hand fingertips touched his forehead. I moved sharply to the right. I don't know what the Karg leaders saw. Maybe I moved in the flick of an eye to them. Reaching the first anti-life creature, I swung the meter-length force blade. The Karg fell into two halves as gouts of machine oil spilled from his carcass. The next few moments were a blur of action. I slaughtered Kargs. They were no match for the Avenger from the Fortress of Light. Jennifer leapt at me. She moved faster than the Kargs, but slower than me. Her knife gleamed with electric power. I swatted the knife with my force blade, destroying it. Then I sidestepped her next leap. She fell toward the deck. In the slow motion time it took her to reach the fore, I slaughtered another seven Kargs. From the deck, she looked up at me. I knelt beside her for just a moment. I'm sorry, I said. Her eyes burned hotter with anger. I should have gone back for you, I spoke, doing it as slowly as I could. Now I have come for you, Jennifer. After this is over, I'll take you away. Liar, she said slowly, as if she had to force out the word. I didn't have any more time for her. Abaddon used another mind trick, this one a blast of knotted pain. I shot to my feet and staggered backward. You cannot win. Abaddon said in my head. I slammed against a wall, lowered my head, and let the coldness of my rage fill me once more. My tenderness toward Jennifer had given the first one an opening. With the rage, I shoved his thoughts out of my mind, sealing them behind a glacial wall. My head rose, and maybe my eyes blazed with cold fire. A new fervor had ignited in me. I see, Abaddon said, turning, heading for the back of his throne. Run, first one, I said. You are mistaken, puppet. He raised a long handle from behind the throne. His fingers pressed buttons. The long handle buzzed with noise. 
a flickering force axe appeared. His was not a pure energy like mine, but red and sizzling. His artifact felt older than mine, much older. I strode at him, building up speed as I crossed the chamber. Look at him race to his death, Abaddon said. He cannot wait to die. I charged him, knowing that he was likely the greatest and most dangerous entity in existence. He had powers of which I couldn't conceive. A personal force shield protected him. He was huge. He could teleport, and I had no doubt he was many times stronger than me. What's more, his force axe could surely shred my amazing suit. I would like to say that I didn't care, but that would be a lie. When fighting the Prince of Lies, it seemed like a poor policy to practice his strengths. I was afraid, but that fear was in a citadel of determination surrounded by a vast moat of icy hatred. The fear watched from a distant vantage point inside of me. He swung the axe. I dared to parry. The two energy forces crackled with power. His strength and speed caused me to fly backward and slam hard against a bulkhead. Abaddon laughed with malice. I had forgotten the joy of hand-to-hand -hand combat. You are a gnat, Commander. You cannot defeat me. I rose stiffly. I should have broken bones. Maybe the suit helped absorb some of the shock. The remaining cargs seemed to move a little faster than before. Their bullets were streaks in the air again. Was my suit losing power? I couldn't worry about that. I was here to win or die, and I'd better win. This time I approached warily. Yes, Abaddon said. You're learning. At that point, two cargs lying on the deck as if dead fired their slug throwers. I heard the shots, turned and dodged the first bullet. The second plowed into my suit's force field. That slowed the bullet long enough for me to shift aside. I also noticed an appreciable quickening in my opponents. My suit couldn't do that too many more times or I would be moving at normal speed again. I would have raced to kill the cargs, but Abaddon attacked, swinging the force axe. I dodged. I parried indirectly, not taking the full brunt of the axe blow, but using my force blade to redirect one of his swings. More shots fired behind me. I couldn't turn, however. Abaddon pressed me too closely. At any moment I expected to hear the sizzle of my suit's force shield and feel myself slow down. That didn't happen. Abaddon's force axe swished past me as I dodged and buried itself into the deck, crackling with power. I used the opportunity, twisting around, wondering why the cargs hadn't finished me. Both of them were slumped on the deck as if really dead this time, with bullet holes in them that leaked oil. Dimitri raised a heavy slug thrower. My friend had broken his restraints. Clearly he had shot those two cargs. Maybe he'd helped Ella, too. She picked up a slug thrower from a dead carg. Abaddon tore the axe blade free. He bellowed and charged me. The next few seconds were the most desperate of my life. I weaved and dodged, parried and kept death at bay by the barest of fractions each time. Twice my force shield sizzled as his red energy blade sparked against it. I staggered away as Dimitri and Ella fired slugs at Abaddon. The first one swatted a bullet away. Another made his force shield glow with power as it devoured the slug. I think Abaddon realized it would hurt him having them firing at him while battling me. Thus he halted, produced a halo around himself, and disappeared. Look out! I shouted. The first one appeared by Dimitri swinging. The Cossack tried to block with his slug thrower. The force axe sheared through the weapon and sliced Dimitri in two each half thudding bloodily onto the deck. Ella scrambled madly out of the way. No, I howled. Dimitri! I charged Abaddon, and my rage was no longer cold but hot. I attacked recklessly, my force blade a blur. Abaddon backpedaled, blocked a swing, sidestepped, and blocked another. I felt myself tiring fast, but I wanted vengeance for Dimitri Rostov. The Cossack had just saved my life, and I'd let him die. I could no longer bear that. Fiend! I shouted, lunging Cobra quick. This time Abaddon didn't parry or jump back fast enough. The tip of my force blade penetrated his personal shield. They both sizzled and sparked, and I felt stiffening resistance, but I was determined. With a grunt, I shoved my force blade tip into his darkened flesh at the hip, burning into skin and muscle. The force axe chopped down. Our two energy weapons roared with a flash. It hurled him backward and caused me to tumble head over heels. I found myself panting on the deck. My forerunner artifact lay several meters from me. The handle was molten and dripping, destroyed. 
His longer handle still seemed whole, although the red-powered force axe was no longer in play. With a groan, Abaddon sat up. I tried to do likewise, but found that my muscles refused to obey my will. Was I already paying the price for overexerting my body? Abaddon worked up to his feet, panting, his face contorted with pain. Ella aimed her carg rifle at him. No, he told her. Put it on the deck. Ella moaned, trembling horribly, trying to fight the command. She could not, at last placing the rifle on the deck. She slumped after that, holding her face in her hands, weeping softly. You fought better than I expected, Abaddon told me. But it wasn't good enough to defeat the greatest being in the universe. He was right, but at least I'd hurt him. That was something, wasn't it? As if to punctuate the thought, the huge first one put a hand on the hip wound, groaning as he did. He took his hand away. It was dark with blood. You will pay for this, mortal, Abaddon said. You will. He quit in mid-sentence, staring in shock at something behind me. I twisted my head to see what the first one was staring at. My jaw dropped at the sight. The curator stood in the chamber. His blue robe glowed and his hair floated. He held his heavy metal rod with both hands. Brother, Abaddon said with scorn. The curator did not speak. His blue eyes blazed with wrath. He seemed the essence of grim justice. He aimed the staff as if it was a weapon. I realized then that it had been buzzing. Now a gout of power flowed from the end. The raw energy struck Abaddon in the chest. The first one howled in agony. I had the feeling his armor and personal shield had weakened, allowing this energy to strike his being directly. The giant first one howled and put his hands in front of the beam. He must have summoned something from inside of him, for he blocked the surge of power, shoving it back a meter from him. The power from the staff kept pouring out, however, beginning to incrementally push the block back at Abaddon. The first one's massive shoulders hunched and his head lowered. His blocking power pushed the gush of energy back a centimeter and then another. Could he shove the power all the way back to the staff? Would that destroy the weapon? The curator's fingers manipulated the metal staff. The buzzing sound quickened until the rod screeched with energy. It shook so violently it seemed the curator had to fight to hold it, like a fireman wrestling a powerful hose. The gout of raw, destroying force became a torrent. It shoved Abaddon's blockage back, back, and back some more. No, Abaddon howled. None thwarts me. None. The facts proved otherwise. The raw power reached his hands, melting them. Yet still Abaddon resisted, using his mental strength. His face had screwed up into a mask of agony. Then the staff's energy began to devour the first one's wrists, crawling up and destroying the forearms. All at once, the blocking force collapsed. The torrent gushed upon Abaddon with full force. For a second, nothing happened. Then a titanic explosion blew the first one apart. It was bloody and sickening and incredibly final. Abaddon was dead and gone like that. It was amazing and unexpected. After all I'd been through, after witnessing Dimitri's horrible death, we'd done it, or the curator had. At that point, my forehead slumped against the deck as I fell unconscious. Chapter 45 I woke up in a bed. It was soft, with smooth sheets and a smoother blanket. It felt good to be between them. Robins tweeted outside. They sang from the branches of an old oak tree. I lay there, absorbing the goodness, glad to be doing nothing at all. I'm not sure how long I lay like that. Finally, though, I shifted my position. I thought about Abaddon and the curator's staff. What had powered the annihilating energy bolt? Is that why the old man had sucked up cloth before? Had the staff used several jelk to make that beam? Had cloth been the final ingredient? The final topping off of the gas tank, as it were? I had a sneaking suspicion that was it. As I lay there, I looked around the room. It reminded me of my bedroom as a teenager. There was the same dresser, the same tennis shoes on the floor. There was a poster of Josie Wales, Clint Eastwood, holding his six-shooters just as it had been in my old bedroom. There was another of my favorite Budweiser swimsuit model. Wait a minute. This was exactly like my old bedroom. I reached to whip back the covers. My arm, the muscles and tendons were just a wee bit stiff. 
I wondered how long I'd been lying here. I moved my arm under the covers, flexing the muscles. It felt as if they'd been sore, very sore, but had now almost recovered. In any case, I pulled back the covers and checked out my bicep. It was huge, deformed long ago by steroid 68. That meant I wasn't in my old bedroom at home. It meant this all wasn't a strange bad dream I'd been having about aliens, bio-terminators, and forerunner artifacts. That meant... The door swung open and the curator stepped inside. I smiled until a terrible sinking feeling swept over me. I'd made an oath before leaving for Abaddon's moth ship. I'd agreed to become the curator's effectuator, whatever that was supposed to mean. Did that mean I'd never see my friends or the sweet earth again? How are you feeling? the curator asked. I'm alive, I said. He pulled up a chair with an old leather jacket draped on the back. The curator sat beside the bed as if he were my grandfather. You don't seem to be too happy about winning, he said. Is Abaddon truly dead? The old man's features clouded. At last, he nodded. Was Abaddon really your brother? Come, the curator said. Let us speak about other matters. That one is too sore for me. I struggled to a sitting position. I was more tired than I realized. I fought for you, I said. He took his time answering. Yes and no, he finally said. You primarily fought to save the human race. He grew thoughtful. I might add that the Earth isn't out of danger yet. Why's that? I asked. We killed Abaddon. Yes, but the super fleet still exists. It is true there was a short, sharp struggle for power in the fleet, but a Karg overlord has emerged. He is still taking the super fleet to Earth. I would imagine so he can destroy the planet and humanity with it. The way you're saying this, I said, it sounds as if you're willing to let me go back to help with the defense. Why wouldn't I? I opened my mouth, reconsidered what I was about to say, and closed it again. A feeling of shame bit, though. It was so foreign to me that I almost didn't know what it represented. The key word there was almost. I did know. I sighed, wondering what was wrong with me. Look, I said. I made an oath. I'm your hitman or something, remember? I recall the oath, he said. But I believe I'm going to modify it. What does that mean? Wait. Before we get into that, I want to know more about Abaddon. I want to understand about the Jelk. Did Cloth die in your staff so you could blast? Please, the curator said, holding up his hands. Let's deal with one question at a time. Yes, Shaw Cloth died. Yes, he and other Jelk powered the blast, as you put it. I had to wait to make my assault until you had drained Abaddon's power sufficiently. I also needed the Karg bodyguards out of the way. That was a courageous and cunning assault, by the way. I congratulate you, Commander. You are a dangerous opponent. I'm a little killer, remember? Now I would dearly like to know what the little killers are. Humans, he said. I understand that much. How did we become the little killers, though? What does that mean, exactly? The curator studied me, finally nodding. You are little in comparison to bigger beings. In this case, that would be the first ones. We're like you? He nodded. But what are you? The first ones, he said. I won't say more on the subject. We had our jobs. We did them, more or less, and some of us. Well, that doesn't matter today. You are like us in many ways, just smaller, weaker, and not as intelligent. Thanks a lot, I said. Does the truth bother you? Nice counterpunch. I said. I suppose it does, but it shouldn't. The truth is the truth. But why were we called killers? It's one of the things you seem to do better than any other race. Do you know why that is? I asked. The curator shrugged. So what happens next? I asked. You will leave this place, he said. I will also take back my survey vessel. Did you beat back the V-Kai assault? It was difficult, but the million cogs helped. Their vicious counterattacks gave me time to remember. He smiled, shaking his head. 
You don't like to say more than you have to, do you? I said. You're heading back to the fringe, he said. Thus too much knowledge can be a bad thing for everyone. By the way, I'll be taking the forerunner artifacts like Holgatha back with me. I didn't have a way to enforce that before, but a few items from Abaddon's flagship will prove useful in that regard. Dimitri is dead, I said, feeling rotten all over again. That is true. However, if ever there was a noble death, it was his. He died helping to save the galaxy from an extended reign of evil. He died to give you a fighting chance to save the human race. Only a chance? I asked. An extremely powerful fleet is headed to Earth. The Karg Overlord has decided he can't annihilate the Jade League without first eliminating the Little Killers. I thought about that and about Holgatha's prediction concerning our odds if we could first eliminate Abaddon. Even given that condition, the Forerunner Artifact had given us terrible odds for winning. Do we have more than a ghost of a chance of defeating the Superfleet? The Curator plucked at his beard. I dislike interfering in such matters as I am the Watchman. I have studied the various elements, though. If the Grand Armada could reach Earth first, you would have a fighting chance. To bring that about, the Earthlings and Starkians would have to slow down the enemy's advance to buy the Grand Armada the needed time. When do I leave? In a few hours, he said. I'll take you in the survey vessel, of course, leaving you on... Mars, I suppose. I thought about that, about Dimitri, and... How's Jennifer? I asked. The curator looked away. Is she dead? I asked. That's an interesting question. Please, I said. Let's stop with the veiled references. Fair enough, he said. The Jennifer you know is long gone. The person in her body is quite different and will never... It's doubtful she will ever accept you, no matter how well I can rehabilitate her. By that, I mean for her to see you will always mean her wanting to kill you. You can't ever change that? Given a normal lifespan, I don't think so. In several hundred years, possibly. He shrugged. I'm going to live several hundred years? No. I frowned. But Jennifer will live that long. If she avoids any unforeseen accidents, yes, he said. But how can she live that long? Did Abaddon modify her? He did, but not in that way. She will live those extra years because I'm keeping her in the Fortress of Light. Hey, I said, sitting straighter. Calm yourself, Commander. It is for the best. But I wanted to tell her... I fell silent, brooding. A person doesn't always get what they want. I'd wanted to defeat Abaddon with all my friends still alive. That hadn't happened. Good old Dmitri Rostov was dead. I would miss my old friend. I would miss his cheerfulness. It seemed so wrong that he was dead. He'd been with me from the beginning of this grand adventure. Now Jennifer would be taken from me yet again. Yet, maybe only the curator had the tools to restore her. Weren't my desires regarding her selfish? I wanted her to love me again. I wanted her to understand why I'd done what I had back at the portal planet. What did Jennifer want in this life other than slitting my belly? The curator seemed like her best bet at becoming normal again. I should give her that. I didn't have to feel bad about this then. Will I ever see her again? I asked. Perhaps, if I call you to my service, the curator said. I had so many questions I wanted to ask. The critical factor for me, though, was the super fleet. Despite Abaddon's death, it was still zeroed in on Earth like a guided missile. A feeling of deja vu struck. This seemed an awful lot like the Purple Emperor coming to destroy Earth three years ago. But this time, I didn't have a way to end everything with a royal duel. This time, I'd have to defeat the enemy fleet with our supposedly inferior but more numerous starships. I looked up at the curator. I have two requests before I go, and one before you take me back to Mars. What are they? he asked. I told him. He looked away. Your requests smack too closely of interference on my part. After what I've done for you, you can't do this for me. He glanced at me, frowning. Had I gone too far? Very well, he said heavily. But we will have to hurry. 
Chapter 46 Before I began my great task, I had an obligation to take care of. I'd been thinking about it as the curator had spoken to me. I would leave the Fortress of Light, but Jennifer would stay behind. She hated me. I'd seen that with my own eyes. It had been difficult to take. Out of all of my actions during my lifetime, leaving Jennifer behind on the portal planet had felt the worst. It rankled in my spirit. I'd lived hard. I'd taken little to no crap from anyone. Yet I had learned a lesson in life. When one was truly at fault, and when one accepted in his heart that he was at fault, it was good to admit it. I opened a door in a special area of the fortress. I walked softly, entering the dark chamber. Dim light, I said. A dim light filled the room. I could see Jennifer asleep in a horizontal glass tube. Alongside her were banks of medical equipment and monitors. She had several medical tubes in her arms and a band over her forehead. I approached the glass with a host of conflicting emotions roiling in my heart. For a brief time in my life, I'd had my true love. I looked through the glass at Jennifer. I hardly recognized her. Abaddon had done so much to modify her. Jennifer had never deserved this. I swallowed hard. I'd put her out of my mind many years ago because I couldn't stand the guilt otherwise. Now, gazing down at her, I closed my eyes. For several breaths. What do you want to hear? I'd failed, Jennifer. I'd left her behind in the hands of the devil. I hadn't had any choice in the matter. If I'd done otherwise... I opened my eyes and I put both hands on the warm tube looking down at her. I don't think you can hear me, I said. But maybe in some manner you will know I came by. Jennifer, honey, I'm so sorry I left you behind. It was wrong. I had no choice. I wish you could forgive me. I realize you can't, and that's... that's what it is. I hope you find peace here at the Fortress of Light. I hope you find what Abaddon stole from you. I don't think you'd feel better after killing me, but heck, maybe you would. Maybe I should offer you my throat to show you how bad I feel. I exhaled, turning away from her. I'm sorry, I said. I love you, for whatever that's worth. Maybe someday we'll meet again, after the curator has healed your mind. Can someone untwist all the bad things Abaddon did to you? That seems like a monumental task. I'm glad the curator is keeping you. I was going to have Ella put you under the Jelk mind machine. I think that would have been wrong, though. I frowned. I was running out of time. What else could I tell her? The door opened. The curator looked in. Give me just a few more seconds, would you? I said. He nodded, closing the door behind him. I turned and looked down at Jennifer for what could be the last time. My heart was heavy, but I was glad I could see her and tell her how sorry I was. I wanted to open the tube. I wanted to kiss her, touch her, and hold her tight. I wanted to stroke her cheek and tell her that everything was going to be okay. Instead, as I'd done on the portal planet, I left her behind. Does that make me sound bitter? I guess I was. I suppose it was impossible to fix every wrong. It left me determined to be grateful for what I had when I had it. I should have enjoyed Jennifer's company more in the little time we had together. Goodbye, I said. Then I hurried out of the chamber. I couldn't take any more of this. The curator stood beside me in the viewing chamber. He showed me the super fleet. It was big, just as it always had been. Still, it was missing a few gigantic snowflake motherships and some battle jumpers. The old man had shown me the wreckages that had come from the brief power struggle. Alexander the Great had been one of Earth's greatest conquerors. He had marched through the Persian Empire and later added parts of India to his vast realm. He'd had big plans for Carthage and the rest of the western Mediterranean, but had died of a fever before he could implement them. Some figured he might have died by poisoning. Alexander had left some of the world's toughest generals behind, and they'd soon had a falling out with each other. The greatest of them had picked parts of the vast realm, setting up independent states. Those states had fought the successor wars. My point is that Alexander's generals hadn't stayed together to increase the Conqueror's realm. Abaddon's super fleet was staying together. Clearly there had been a short, sharp fight among some of the leaders. No doubt the fight had determined who would rule, who would obey, and who had to die. 
This Karg overlord must be several times stronger, smarter, tougher, or more ruthless than his competitors. He'd quash them. That would seem to include whatever gel could remain with the fleet. Otherwise, those battle jumpers would have gone elsewhere with their saurian crews. I studied the enemy fleet. I made notes, recording them with my Lohar-made tablet. Can you show me their likely route to Earth? I asked. The curator looked down at me with an unblinking stare. Does that mean no? I asked. You are stretching my limits, he said at last. I don't mean to. Nevertheless, he said. I went back to studying the fleet, using what time I had left. Then the old man sighed, surprising me as he showed me the most likely route to the solar system. I made sure to keep the alien recorder going. I was going to use this data to try to figure out a way to beat them and save humanity once again. Chapter 47 So... Cloth and Abaddon were dead. Jennifer was free from her enforced servitude and in the best place in the galaxy where she might rehabilitate her body, mind, and spirit. I'd achieved some of my greatest desires. The most important want, however, was yet to be fulfilled. The Earth and humanity with it was under a dire threat. As far as I could see, this was the big one that might solve a lot of our future problems. If the Jade League could annihilate the Karg Jelk Superfleet, we could finish off the Jelk Corporation for good. Humanity could then start thinking about colonizing the nearest Jelk frontier planets. I had been to Sagittarius A-Star and back. I'd been in hyperspace before and another space-time continuum. I'd handled weapons and worn suits that belonged in a super science museum. As Star Vikings, we'd teleported on a Forerunner artifact. Later, as Earth Force assault troopers, we'd teleported inside an ancient survey vessel and had used incredible T-suits. In the end, though, I was back to bioskin assault troopers, shuttles, and starships, and I was back to the friends humanity had made these past years. The curator's survey vessel made a slight detour before taking us to Mars. It transferred to the Pollux system, the present location of the Grand Armada. It contained an even greater number of warships than the Superfleet. Our appearance caused a commotion in the vast Armada until I spoke via screen to the commanding Baron Visconti of Orange Tamica. In the past, we'd worked together while facing Purple Tamika's monster fleet. Visconti was a good tiger and one of the biggest I'd ever met. The Lohar stood a good seven and a half feet tall, a towering individual. Even better, he had the widest and deepest chest I'd ever seen on a Lohar. Baron Visconti was the Armada's Lord Admiral and wore a tight-fitting uniform with several medals for courage and cunning. The Grand Armada had a multitude of vessels from the various races that made up the Jade League. It had masses of pursuit destroyers, hordes of strike and attack cruisers, and an unbelievable number of mainline carriers. Yet for all that, its real power lay in the orange and purple Tamika specialty vessels. Orange Tamika fielded maulers. They were round vessels with five times the mass of a battle jumper. All the Grand Armada's battle jumpers belonged to the Earth Force contingent, by the way. In any case, maulers were heavy hitters, able to absorb an appalling amount of damage and still keep coming. Yet they weren't the largest ships in the Grand Armada. That went to the Purple Tamika Bombards. They had massively armored hulls and double-strength shields. Their weakness was a lack of speed. They were best used in massed battles. In many ways, the Grand Armada was like an old-style Greek phalanx. It did best in head-to-head -head encounters. Many space battles, however, were more hit-and-run or hide-and-ambush affairs. Could we get this mass in front of the Superfleet and force the enemy to fight the way we wanted? Those were pretty big ifs. We have little time for such a delay, the curator told me. Give me an hour with them, no more, I said. An hour, he said sourly. I still spoke via screen to Baron Visconti and told him I'd like to meet on his flagship. He agreed. Soon N7 and I flew in a shuttle to Visconti's flagship mauler. It felt strange marching down a Lohar battlecraft again. The old tiger smells, the fierce looks they gave me. It brought back memories, all right. I wore my most stylish uniform with the 44 on my hip. The Lohars viewed my magnum with something approaching awe. I entered a large conference chamber. I saw old Admiral Saris of Purple Tamika and others I recognized from years ago. Baron Visconti approached. He'd put on weight since I'd last seen him, and there were streaks of white in his facial fur. He was still impressive, maybe more so. We embraced and shook hands. Then I scanned the throng. 
I have little time, I told them, and I'm not sure you'll believe all I've been through. Here's the key part. Abaddon is dead. That created a stir and then bedlam. After half a minute of excited chatter among those present, the Baron rose. He'd sat down once I'd begun addressing the assembly. Visconti roared in a loud voice as only Lohars can do, bringing silence to the great chamber. It was a good thing, too, as I'd been about to fire my forty-four to get their attention. You said you are in a rush, Commander, Visconti said. I nodded. And your moonship appeared before the Armada like a forerunner artifact. It also fits the description of the attack vessel that raided many of our star systems. I stared at the assembled tigers, Ilk, and others. I'd been wondering for some time how to get them to listen and do what I told them without hours of convincing. Finally, I took out my recorder and showed them a holographic image of the enemy superfleet. That got their attention in a hurry. If you'll listen to me, I said, I'll tell you how to defeat the Karg Jelk invasion fleet. We are listening, Visconti told me. I began to tell them how to do the improbable. Afterward, I returned to the survey vessel. An hour later, the curator brought us to Mars. He also returned the borrowed T-scanner to Holgatha. Then the first one left, taking all the Forerunner artifacts with him. They had been staying near Ceres, protecting Holgatha. The curator had told the artifacts that they were in the wrong zone. From now on, each zone and cultural level would have to fight within the proper technological weapons it was allowed. In case you're wondering, I'd asked him about the moth ships and the remaining Jelk. They used highly advanced weapons and ship systems greater than this fringe zone should allow. The curator had hemmed and hawed, finally saying that we had our advanced experiences to offset those powers. That was just great. The superfleet was partly composed of ships from another space-time continuum. On various occasions, those moth ships had done a number against Lohar dreadnoughts and Jelk battlejumpers. They were the best fighting vessels for the coming encounter, better even than the Purple Tamika bombards. How could Earth Force and the Starkian fleet slow them down long enough to bring the Grand Armada into play as I'd planned? Maybe as importantly, how could the Grand Armada defeat a superfleet only slightly less numerous than itself? I had my answer, but I had to wait to let others in the solar system in on it. First, I let them spout off in order to get it out of their systems. We met in a big auditorium on Mars, with a gigantic screen behind me. Earth's Prime Minister was in attendance, the various flotilla chiefs, including First Admiral Rollo Anderson, and Baba Gobo and my old friend Kaka Ro, a Starkian war leader. Baba was the size of a baboon with similar fur. He had two yellowed canines at the end of a wrinkled muzzle and must have weighed ninety pounds. He had an old man's belly and a snow-white mane like a lion. Instead of sitting on a chair, Baba sat on a small raised dais where his chair would have been. Beside him sat Kaka Ro, a younger, sleeker, darker-furred, and very cunning Starkian commander. We had Earth Force, the Starkian fleet, and several flotillas from nearby races. That was a pittance compared to the coming superfleet. After hours of debate, I figured the time was right to start talking. We have one advantage, I told the assembled throng. We know their destination, Earth. My suggestion is simple. We need to seed their path with mass drones and missiles striking in such a way that they slow down to take care of each threat. Using the screen and showing them the Superfleet's likely path, I outlined the strategy. There was silence afterward. The strategy called for a vast expenditure of missiles. That meant stripping them from every available source. I would take them from Earth's silos and from our battle jumpers and escort vessels. That would leave our ships and Earth's lair defense woefully short of missiles during the main battle. I do not like to disagree with you, Commander, Baba Gobo said, but I believe that's too wasteful of our resources. It is also a grave risk, leaving us with too little on the day we will need everything. I agree with our good Starkian neighbor, Diana said promptly. What was the old saying? A prophet is never honored in his hometown. On the day we will need everything, I repeated slowly. That's exactly why we have to use our missiles wastefully and prodigiously beforehand. We're trying to slow down the superfleet so the Grand Armada will be here on the day of battle. Remember, wars aren't only about physical destruction. They're also about getting into the enemy commander's mind. We have to alter the Overlord's decisions. If we use our missiles as I suggest, the Overlord will start to get nervous. 
He might believe we have an unlimited supply. If he thinks every advance will be met with hordes of missiles, he'll go more slowly so he won't lose too many warships. Does a Karg think like this? Baba Gobo asked. He had a point. I wasn't sure. I hoped so. I don't know how a Karg thinks, I admitted. But we're not only dealing with Kargs. Saurians make up a large part of the fleet. With massed missile attacks in every star system, we force the enemy to fight every step of the way. They'll be on constant red alert. They'll use up masses of PD shells and anti-missile missiles. Remember, they're a long way from home. They only have so much ordnance with them. We're near our supply bases. That made a huge difference when the English battled the Spanish Armada. Both sides ran short of gunpowder and shot back then. The English replenished their ships more easily because they were fighting off their own coast. The Spanish ran perilously low on both. Or take the Battle of El Alamein in World War II. The Germans were trying to push through to Egypt, but they were at the long end of their supply route. Most of the badly needed fuel was burned up by the trucks, bringing them their few supplies. The British massively... Yes, yes, Diana said. We understand the principle. It's the risk that is so daunting. This is a risk, I agreed. The Kargs might push through, accepting horrible losses to get to Earth faster. I'm not sure the Saurians will feel that way. But why would the Kargs accept such losses? They don't know how close our Grand Armada is? Do you know that as fact? Baba Gobo asked. No, I said. The Kargs might burn through your missile masses because they know exactly how close the Grand Armada is, Baba Gobo said. I'll grant you it's a possibility, although a small one. I suggest we gather all we have into one massive front, Baba Gobo said. We will... No, I said. The idea is to buy time. My idea most likely buys us time without burning up our ships and crews. Let the missiles do the heavy lifting. This is going to be bloody, Diana said. Let's not make it more bloody than it has to be, I told her. There were further debates, more suggested strategies. Fortunately, Kakaro threw his considerable reputation behind me. That finally won over Baba Gobo. At last, grudgingly, Diana accepted the plan as well. We would do this my way. Now would come the hard part, implementing the plan. A lot would depend on the reaction of this new Karg overlord. Chapter 48 our fastest advanced scouts found the superfleet in the Gamma AE system. That was a relief. It meant the curator had been right concerning their path. That meant the superfleet would reach the solar system through the farthest outer planet's jump gate. My plan had been predicated on that being the case. I planned to use the Earth as a lure during the tactical phase of the campaign, meaning in the middle of the massed fleet battle. Was that madness? Did I risk humanity for a possible small or even non-existent tactical advantage? Wasn't the better idea to destroy the super fleet as far away from the solar system as possible? Of course, that would be the better idea. I felt, though, that we needed every advantage to win decisively. We'd gotten rid of Abaddon. Now, could I get the Karg Overlord to act how I needed him to act? In the Gamma AE system, the super fleet moved as before, like a giant school of sharks. They stayed together. I was betting the Karg Overlord was going to stick as close to Abaddon's plan as possible. The Gamma AE system had ten planets, four terrestrial or Earth-like, and the rest gas giants. It was a normal system in that the gas giants were far from the star. The terrestrial planets were in the inner system. Five of our scouts, far apart from each other, rushed the massed enemy formation in the outer planets region. Their presence did nothing to halt the enemy's acceleration, which was too bad but not unexpected. I remained far behind in our battle jumper, sending a scout ship back through the inner planet's gate to notify the rest of our advance flotilla what was happening. I kept the majority of the advance flotilla in the next door star system. The five scouts heading toward the super fleet made a turning maneuver, using a gas giant to slingshot away from the enemy. Over a billion kilometers away from the scouts, Jelk battle jumpers nosed forward, advancing ahead of the super fleet. They launched T missiles. The scouts never had a chance. The T-missiles appeared among the five scouts, exploding with antimatter warheads. The blasts shredded the scouts as if they'd been built of tinfoil. It was a good thing I'd used automated scout ships, as no humans had died. Still, sending the scouting force now seemed as if it had been a wasteful maneuver. 
The rest of us immediately retreated through the jump gate out of Gamma AE. We moved through the gate to the Epsilon Indi system. Epsilon Indi was a mere ten light years from Earth in a straight line. Fortunately, the jump gate route from Epsilon Indi led to the Inez star system. I met an advanced flotilla of supply ships. As fast as possible, they unloaded their massed drones. As they did, the rest of us raced for the jump gate that would take us to the Inez star system. It took a day and a half before the first enemy ships used the jump gate leading from Gamma AE into the Epsilon Indi system. I smiled. It seemed the Karg Overlord had come down with a case of caution after all. That was heartening. We'd used five scouts. That many scouts might have indicated our main fleet was close by. It's what I'd wanted the Overlord to think. To help solidify the idea, we had nearly 500,000 missiles and drones hidden in the Epsilon Indi system. We also had a hundred T-missiles ready and waiting. After a two-hour scan of the system, an enemy battle jumper went back to Gamma AE. Soon, the superfleet began coming through the gate. Several hours later, it began accelerating for the jump gate on the other end of the system, the gate my battle jumper had parked beside. Now began what was later called the Skirmish of Epsilon Indi. Our drones and missiles had the latest stealth technology. They remained hidden from the enemy as long as they stayed cold and still. With a secret pulse from my battle jumper, the first thousand missiles near a gas giant accelerated into life. The enemy spotted them almost right away. A few enemy T-missiles popped off at strategic locations. Soon, our first thousand drones were slags of molten metal or useless hulks burned out by enemy EMP blasts. I started another thousand at the enemy formation. The same thing happened. For the next seven hours, I kept launching thousand group missiles at the enemy fleet. At first, I wanted them overconfident. Then I wanted them to wonder why we were so wasteful as to keep doing this hour after hour. At the eighth hour, the enemy refrained from using up any more of their T-missiles. Maybe the Overlord figured that was our plan, to make him waste a precious resource. He was right. It was one of our ideas, but not the main one at the moment. Our drones finally began closing in on the enemy formation, reaching the outer limit of their moth ship's red beams. Those eerie beams drilled through space, destroying one of our drones after another. It was at that point I launched the bulk of our antimatter warhead T-missiles. We destroyed several battle jumpers and hammered a Karg moth ship, blowing a vicious atmosphere into space out of a hull breach. After that, the enemy became more deliberate, timing the rest of the T-missiles. This wasn't like Forerunner teleport tech. Our moon ship and the Forerunner artifacts appeared whole in a second of time. Fringe zone teleporting technology wasn't as good. It took several seconds for a T-missile to materialize into its new location. That gave enemy gunners time to pour point defense shells at the solidifying T-missiles. The missiles had to solidify before the warheads could ignite. Creed, Rollo said excitedly. Do you see? Do you see? I saw, all right. I sat in my command chair holding myself perfectly still. The enemy fleet was slowing down. The destroyed battle jumpers and the direct hit to the moth ship seemed to have the needed effect. We didn't have any more T-missiles in this system, but they didn't know that. We did have a lot more ordinary missiles. We would keep expending them. The key was the enemy reaction. I could give a complete rendition of the entire skirmish. That might prove tedious, though. We had achieved our first and primary objective. The enemy fleet slowed to a crawl as our half a million drones continued to accelerate at them in 1,000 and later 10,000 missile packs. We scratched another enemy battle jumper and managed to destroy a moth ship, but that was it in terms of kills. Yes, the expenditure was prodigious on our side. Maybe I'd used more missiles here than I should have. But nothing went perfectly in war. If nothing else, I forced them to expend masses of PD ammo and many of their T-missiles. Now I had to keep them at this crawl. If I could do that, my plan might actually work. Chapter 49 For eight more days, we expended missiles in one star system after another. It was clear we needed nine days, as the Grand Armada was not yet in position according to the original plan. That meant I had to reach into my back pocket for Plan B. No one said we would live forever, I told my commanders in a packed conference chamber aboard Rollo's flagship. Are you talking about facing their entire fleet by ourselves? An escort cruiser commander asked me. The Spartans faced the entire Persian army at Thermopylae, I said. I was talking about the legendary 300. 
Those Spartans all died, the escort commander said. Yes, I said, staring at the man. They died, but in doing so, they helped Greece beat the invaders. Do we stand our ground to buy humanity life, or do we run to save our sorry hides? The man licked his lips. I could see his inner turmoil. We stand, he said softly. Yes, I said. We stand. The bulk of Earth Force and the Starkian fleet waited in the asteroid belt near Ceres. Far beyond us, near Neptune, was a vast drone and missile belt a million strong. That had used up every remaining missile that humanity and the Starkians had left, including tens of thousands rushed from Earth's churning factories. The missiles in the silos on Earth and Luna were empty, as I'd said earlier. Earth and Luna Command only had beam weapons left to defend the home world. That was just like our starships. We had beams and PD guns, but had used up all our missiles trying to buy the Grand Armada the needed days and then hours to get here. I no longer felt so sanguine about pulling this off. I kept reminding myself Cloth and Abaddon were dead and Jennifer was safe. Three out of four wasn't bad, was it? Look at that, Creed, Rollo said. I studied the main screen. The solar system's farthest jump gate glowed yellow. The first enemy ship was coming through. In reality, it had come through some time ago. We only saw this as fast as light could travel. I closed my eyes. We needed just a little more time. I hated the thought of burning up our starships and seeing the entire Starkian fleet destroyed. Even that might not be enough. We have to win this one for Dimitri, I said. Rollo turned to me. Everyone on the bridge listened. I opened my eyes and sat straighter. We have to win this for Zoe Artemis, and for all the people who died to give us this chance. Will they have died in vain? Rollo's thick features tightened. No, a weapons officer said hoarsely. Remember that when your guts turn to water, I said loudly. No matter what, we have to buy our people more time. The Grand Armada is close. If we can do this... I saw the determination in their eyes, but I also saw lingering fear. That would have to do. The battle for Earth began as the enemy fleet changed the basic set of its advance. Instead of the close-knit shark school, the Karg overlord ordered his fleet to spread out. It came onward as a thin oval sheet, like a giant net heading toward the vast drone field. The drones and missiles waited at a Neptune range. Those missiles were still billions of kilometers from the approaching enemy. Hours passed, half a day and finally a day. The enemy fleet maintained its thin, widely spaced oval position. Each enemy ship was far enough from the other that a T-missile would have to pick and choose which one to attack. The moth ships moved individually now, the bigger mothership snowflakes hanging back in a Uranus orbit. Rollo and I had each slept since first sighting the enemy fleet. Now we were back on the bridge. Ella was on Earth to coordinate any last-ditch defenses. N-7 was in a scout ship, hopefully by now with the Grand Armada. The Grand Armada would enter the solar system through a jump gate near Neptune. Would they do so before the super fleet reached Earth, or after the third planet was a burning cinder? Give the order, I told Rollo. Earth Force and Starkian fleet drone operators began their business. The last great drone and missile mass near Neptune began to accelerate toward the oncoming super fleet. A million missiles all at once was an incredible number. Did the enemy realize it was our last missile barrage, or would they believe we had many more waves of missiles to send at them? For over a week now, they had faced these endless missile barrages. Could that be weighing on them? Or did they tell each other, this is the last one? War was risk. War was playing your cards and hoping they were higher than the enemy's cards. Red carg beams burned thousands upon thousands of our missiles. Jelk battle jumper lasers and PD guns took down more. I found it interesting that the enemy didn't use any anti-missiles. Could they have run out of them? On some moth ships, the red eyes flickered and went out. I watched a missile slam into such a vessel, detonating. It made me grunt with appreciation. The encounter seemed endless until the last missile blew apart from an enemy beam. There were almost a hundred enemy battle jumper wrecks drifting in space. Only a few moth ships had been destroyed, though. Remorselessly, the enemy formation continued to fly toward Earth. I thought the missiles would kill more, Rollo told me. I was too tight-lipped to speak. I'd thought the same thing. The superfleet kept coming. Finally, their most forward ships reached Jupiter. Now, I said, unable to hold it in. Now, you have to start coming through now. 
Nothing different happened, though. No Grand Armada starships came through the jump gate. I felt like a dismal failure. The enemy's oval formation was halfway between Jupiter and the asteroid belt when Rollo shouted. Others took up his cry. I'd grown sluggish, with my chin on my chest. I looked up, seeing the first Grand Armada ships finally coming through the Neptune jump gate. I inhaled sharply, calculating distances and acceleration rates in my head. The conclusion was obvious. Likely, many on the bridge realized the same thing I did. The others began looking at me, waiting. If we could force the enemy to stop or slow down, it would give the Grand Armada ships time to catch up. Give the order to attack, I said. The first admiral went to his comm, giving the order. All over the asteroid belt, starships began powering up as we headed at the enemy. The final clinch was upon us. As our battle jumper began accelerating, I realized something else. I grabbed an analyzer, punching in numbers. This was more than interesting. Renewed hope burned in my heart. We might have inadvertently stumbled upon a secret winning strategy, but to pull it off we'd have to do the hardest fighting of our life. One of the most perfect battles ever fought had been between Hannibal of Carthage and Rome. It had been the Battle of Cannae, and what made it perfect was that Hannibal's soldiers had surrounded the Romans on all sides. They'd squeezed the giant Roman host, turning it into a mob of men. The Carthaginian soldiers, with half the enemy's numbers, had butchered the legionaries in the tens of thousands that day. We'd just surrounded the superfleet. Could we squeeze the enemy, though? The day of battle was here. Earth Force and the Starkian fleet had just become the screen trying to hold up the superfleet. In the Battle of Cannae, Hannibal had used his Gallic enemies to face the dreaded Roman legions. Those wild Gauls had fought savagely. Even so, the grim legionaries had shoved them back, killing and advancing. The Gallic line had bent, came near to breaking, but it held just long enough for Hannibal's Libyan veterans to close the giant trap. When the Grand Armada came into position, we would have to act the part of Gauls. That meant many of us would die today. The onrushing superfleet badly outnumbered Earth Force and the Starkian fleet. Could we force the Kargs and Jelk to slow down? I'd planned to use the asteroids in the belt like trees in a forest. We would have used the rocks to shield us, leaning out like snipers to hit individual enemy vessels. Now, Earth Force and the Starkian fleet took up a giant cone formation. The largest Starkian shark-shaped vessels formed the outer rim of the cone. Those ships had the strongest shields and hull armor. They would take a pounding, no doubt there. Their job would be to protect the rest of us. Then the cone would pour massed fire upon individual superfleet vessels, destroying them one by one as fast as possible. It was a ragged cone. Rollo and other flotilla commanders gave constant orders. Starkian leaders did likewise. Our cone had accidents. Several ships had to fall out. Still, we advanced toward the vast mass of dots ahead of us. This is insane, Rollo confided to me in a whisper. We're all going to die. Everyone dies, I said. Rollo stood beside me as we watched the enemy formation. Minutes passed and became a half hour. Space battles always took a long time to unfold. Sir, a censor officer said. I see it, Rollo said. He turned to me. I watched stoically. Inside, though, I was grinning. Originally, Holgatha had given us a 5% chance of victory, provided the enemy did something stupid. For stupidity to help us, however, first the great Abaddon had to die. Abaddon was dead, along with some of the most important Karg leaders. I'd slain some of those Karg leaders myself with a curator's force blade. Many of the most cunning Jelk were dead, gone, or imprisoned by the Overlord. The cleverest Jelk of all was gone, Shaw Cloth. How cunning was the Overlord? Maybe as important, did he have anyone on his side to bounce ideas off of? Maybe his best warlords had perished by my hand. That was a nice thought. Seeing this was even better. The Overlord made a move we desperately needed. He'd faced endless drone and missile assaults now for days upon days in every star system. How was he supposed to know we'd run out of missiles? For all he knew, he had to battle hordes more before he could reach Earth. Now, though, the Grand Armada was behind him and coming on fast. He was encircled after a fashion, something no space commander wanted. Still, the Overlord clearly wanted to destroy Earth, but it now appeared he did not want to sacrifice the bulk of his moth ships to do it. Thus he made one of the worst blunders on the battlefield. He began to split his forces. 
While some of the greatest captains in history had done that and gotten away with it, the Overlord wasn't one of those geniuses of battle. He let the Jelk battle jumpers continue to advance upon the cone. Meanwhile, the Moth ships made a turning maneuver. It appeared as if the Moth ships were trying to do an exit stage left, maybe to swing wide and avoid the Grand Armada behind them. I had an idea of what the battle jumpers were supposed to do get close enough to Earth to launch whatever T missiles they had left. Maybe some of those warheads would contain bio terminators. Before the enemy battle jumpers reached the range of our cone and its beams, they launched T missiles. Those vanished, reappearing far away from us but near Earth and Luna. I hoped Ella could take care of them. Now the Jelk battle jumpers began a hard turning maneuver, following the cargs well ahead of them. As I sat watching, I nodded in appreciation. The T-missile attack on Earth reminded me of the Japanese at the Battle of Midway. They tried to take out Midway Airfield and the American carriers at the same time. That had been a terrible mistake. Concentration of effort was one of the key rules of war. That was the lore of Earth I'd talked about before. The Karg Overlord had just tried to destroy Earth on the cheap at the worst possible moment. An hour later, as our cone formation gained on them and as the Grand Armada accelerated, the Karg Overlord appeared to change his mind once again. Maybe his monitors showed him the T-missiles had failed to take out Earth. Ella had done her job with beams and fighters, having lost a quarter of her pilots in the process. The Overlord now remaneuvered to try to bring his split fleet together again. I imagine he planned to blast through us and destroy the Earth before facing the Grand Armada. It wasn't the worst plan. It gave us time to close the trap and possibly die. The superfleet had become two smaller ovals. The battle jumpers slowed down and changed heading. That allowed the Kargs to catch up with the Jelk commanded Saurians. During that time, we changed the heading of the cone, coming at the reunited oval. The Karg Jelk maneuvering had cost them precious time. The Karg red beam struck farthest. It was like a thousand angry moths. They smashed against the front rim Starkian shark ships. Shields glowed, stood fast for a time, buckled, and finally collapsed one by one. The beams tore into those heavy hulls. The Starkeens didn't have super hulls, but these had thick ones. The red beams burned deeper, making molten work of them. The first giant shark ship went critical, exploding, taking three others down with it. Fortunately, the force shields behind them held fast. Now the moth ships began to destroy the outer rim Starkeens with fierce regularity. No enemy T-missiles appeared. No regular ones slid to the attack. What did happen was that the ragged cone reached its beam range. On our flagship, Rollo gave Kirk commands. The engines purred. Our heavy beams joined hundreds of others to make one giant fist. Like an annihilating light, it smashed against an enemy battle jumper. The force shield and hull went down fast, causing an explosion. There was little for me to do but observe. It was hard because I watched the enemy destroy the cone ship by ship. We hammered them, though. We devoured what seemed like an endless supply of Jelk battle jumpers. Hull debris, water vapor, bodies, far too many of those. Coils, spent casings, shredded bulkheads, and other junk drifted by. The cone was gone. The oval net was coming around us. We had become bait, and the enemy ate our vessels. Creed! Rallo said, staggering to me as a shuddering explosion rocked our battle jumper. Keep fighting, I said. Rallo nodded. He issued the same order to his ships. The cone died. Our Earth Force ships were shattered. The Starkian fleet had all but vanished from existence. There were a few of us left. We beamed, killing another enemy vessel, and we watched, drained of emotion, as the vast net sucking the last life from us quit firing in our direction. We'd bought our side time. It had cost us dearly, but we had stood our ground like the ancient 300 at Thermopylae. It was a terrible and glorious thing. The Grand Armada had finally come within firing range of the rearward cargs. I'll give the Overlord this. He didn't bother anymore with our handful of surviving vessels. He threw everything at the Grand Armada. I think he believed he could beat them, and maybe with the moth ships he could have. The two sides fought it out with brutal savagery, showing a blizzard of beams on our main screen. I began to wonder if the Overlord was smarter than I'd given him credit for. Those horrible red beams devoured the forward bombards and maulers. I couldn't believe it. Once they died, nothing could stand against the moth ships for more than a few seconds. After all my work... Creed, Rallo said in a harsh voice. Do you see that? I rubbed my eyes. 
It was a grim decision, but I think I understood. Baron Visconti must have ordered his fast-strike cruisers and pursuit destroyers into the van of battle. Standard battle procedure called for them to stay on the sides and nip at the enemy. Instead, these cruisers and destroyers with their light hulls rushed to the forefront. They had the speed to do it, but no shields or armor to speak of, not compared to maulers and bombards. Those light starships died in droves, but by doing so, they absorbed the fury of the reg karg beams. The butchery made me sick. What it did, though, was give the bombards and maulers time to close. Once near enough to the enemy, their heavy beams finally began to puncture karg hulls. That's when it became the Grand Armada's turn to butcher the enemy. The next hour and a half became legendary. At far range, the moth ships outmatched the maulers and bombards. At close range, they became equals. Our greater numbers and freshness told then. It was brutal. It was a slugfest. And in this kind of encounter, numbers counted as much as high technology. For once, we held the advantage, and Visconti never let it go. What seemed like a lifetime later, the terrible battle entered the mop-up phase. We had taken terrible losses, almost three-fifths of our starting numbers if one included both fleets. But we annihilated the enemy. The Karg Jelk superfleet was no more than a handful of vessels racing for a jump gate. That day we won the greatest battle in the Orion Arm in a thousand years. In fact, the Jade League Jelk Corporation War was over. The victory was decided in the solar system in what became known as Fortress Earth. Rollo clapped me on the shoulder. I punched him in the chest. Then we began the sober task of searching for survivors. After years of intense suffering, it looked as if humanity might finally breathe a great sigh of relief. Epilogue a year and several months later, I sat on a bench in New St. Petersburg overlooking the Baltic Sea. The city was twenty kilometers from the blasted site of old St. Petersburg. Russian birds sang in nearby fir trees. They had yellow breasts and tweeted louder than I could believe. Maybe they were happy to be alive. I knew I was. A grand year and a half had passed since we destroyed the superfleet. Our scientists had scoured the wreckages for months prying loose the advanced Karg systems. We had finally begun to implement some of the more interesting Karg technologies and were working on the rest. I'm sad to report that there had been rumblings in the former Jade League. Instead of everyone rejoicing for the next century with glad tidings all around, former friends had begun to get angry with each other. It was simple, really. Now that the Jelk and Kargs were gone for good, former allies finally began to realize what bastards their neighbors really were. History has taught us that that was the nature of wartime alliances. Once the enemy pressure left, people remembered past injustices. People, all aliens, I suppose, followed the path of their own self-interest. It was the way of the universe, so why fight it? Still, it left me feeling sad. We'd all gone through so much together. We'd all sacrificed for the greater good. Now lesser people squabbled and restarted old feuds. On the home front, Diana was still our prime minister, so we were doing pretty well in the scheme of stellar things. We'd already claimed several choice old Jelk frontier planets as ours. Nobody in our neck of the Orion arm cared to mess with the little killers. I guess we had a pretty scary rep, especially now. Diana knew how to use that. Me? I'd written a big fat book about my adventures. Most aliens believed me as well as Marco Polo's contemporaries had believed him which was to say not at all. Still, the aliens and humans had bought lots of copies of my adventures. That meant my bank account was doing fine. For the first time in years, I felt as if I could unwind. I'd left the assault troopers several months ago, becoming a private citizen. For two months, I'd hiked in the wilds, tramped through our new cities, and went to a few book signings, drinking too much coffee and eating endless donuts. I didn't know what I wanted anymore. No more aliens were breathing down our collective necks, and... Okay, I'll level with you. I kept thinking about Jennifer. I wondered about the curator, the real scoop concerning Abaddon, the v Kai, and the creator. What was it all about, anyway? What did the Forerunner artifacts do in the center of the galaxy? How come our galaxy was split into zones? I sighed, stretching my legs, watching seagulls wheel overhead. I guess I'd never know those things. That had started to bother me. 
Maybe twenty minutes later, I saw a babe walking down the path from the nearby university. She knew how to use what she had, all right, and those breasts straining against her blouse. Hello, Creed, Ella shouted as she waved to me. I stood up, waving back. Ella ran, slowing as she neared me. Finally, she held out her hands. I took hers. I wanted to hug her, but I didn't know if I should. What's the matter, Commander? I shook my head. It's just Creed these days. She looked into my eyes. Do you want to sit down? Sure. Ella sat beside me on the bench. After a time, she threaded an arm through mine, snuggling up next to me. We watched the seagulls. You keep thinking about her, don't you? She said. I didn't answer. Creed, you need to find something to do. Like what? I asked. I think Earth has become too small for you. Come on, I said. That's bogus. No. I think that's the curse Abaddon gave you. You killed him. The curator did that. Only after you softened up the most dangerous being in the galaxy, Ella said. Anyway, as I was saying, Abaddon cursed you. Remember in your book how you said the curator said Abaddon corrupted everything he touched? I remember. He's corrupted you. I didn't want to believe that. No, I said. I already was corrupt. Not like that, she said. I mean being able to enjoy yourself. I don't know if you can anymore. You need adventure. The spice of terrible adventure. I wondered if that was true. She squeezed my arm. I have to go. I have an appointment. Will you come to my place later? I shook my head. Ella let go of me, standing. She glanced into the distance and then studied me closely. Why do I have the feeling I'm never going to see you again? What? That's ridiculous. Goodbye, Commander Creed, Ella said. It has been an honor knowing you. She bent low and kissed me on the cheek. When she straightened, there were tears in her eyes. Ella, what's gotten into you? She swallowed. Then she glanced behind me in the distance, turned back to the university path, and hurried away. I thrust my hands into my pockets. That had been weird. Five minutes later, I heard the scrape of shoes behind me. I didn't turn. I didn't want to see who was there. A massive old man with a huge white beard and dressed in a greatcoat came around to sit with me on the bench. For a time, the curator and I simply watched the waves. I spoke too prematurely some time ago, he told me. Yeah? I asked. I am going to need your services after all. As your effectuator? I asked. He nodded. What about Jennifer? We will deal with that if and when it comes up, he said. For now, you will be far from the Fortress of Light. I turned to fully face the old man. What does an effectuator do, anyway? The curator considered that, finally saying, He helps me take care of delicate problems. How? With his mind, with his cunning, and sometimes with barbaric weapons, the curator said. It was crazy, but I felt a new excitement well up in me. I hadn't felt this way since... since we'd beaten the super fleet. Maybe Ella had it right. I needed to do something, something important to feel right. I stood up. So did the curator. Are you willing to come with me? He asked. Sure, why not? I said. Then let's go. I don't like leaving my ship on automatic any longer than I have to. I walked with the curator, wondering if I'd ever see the green hills of Earth again. The feeling didn't last long, though. My curiosity about what lay ahead took hold. I could hardly wait to get started as the curator's newest galactic effectuator. This has been an Audible Studios production of Fortress Earth, Extinction Wars Book 4. Written by Vaughn Hepner. Performed by Christian Rummel. Producer Mike Charzik. Copyright 2016 Vaughn Hepner. Production Copyright 2016 by Audible Inc. Audible Studios is a division of Audible Inc.